The story begun deep within the terrain of Kin Nui Mountain, where the Toad Ridge can be found perched high above. There were houses that were almost empty in this community by the name of Toad Village. A man was narrating to his companion that when their old leader was around, they were so strong that even the local bandits listened to them. But when their leader died, the remaining brothers all ditched the new village master and ran away, and now they are the only ones remaining. The officers will soon arrive and clear out the bandits, they couldn't even defend against them, and they won't survive if they stay any longer. He urges his companion to flee the new village master before it's too late. Another man, whose clothing was wrapped and hung on a pole, emerged and expressed his dismay that the new leader was only 18, calling him too young and naive, before asking if they still planned to ditch him. He screamed righteously, telling those who wanted to leave their leader to get lost right away. He then ran off while grinning, saying he would go first, leaving his colleagues behind. Yet shortly after that, they smiled, looked at each other, and decided to leave as well. Cheng Dali sat in a wooden chair beneath the tiger skin rug while his hand was placed on his head, complaining that it hurts. He continued complaining about the memories pouring into his head and wondered if he may have been transported to another world. Cheng Dali was just a normal university student, playing in front of his computer with his headphones on, a strategic game called Hearts of the Mountain Bandits, when he suddenly fainted and woke up in a different world. His memories and the current body he was in were merging into one. In these memories, there was a village in despair. He became the owner of this poor village after his father passed away. Dawu was founded 120 years ago, and under its jurisdiction were 108 cities and 13 prefectures. It once ruled the sea and the land, but that was a very long time ago. Today, Dawu's imperial power was weakening, and people suffered due to the endless wars that happened almost every year. Those who couldn't survive had no other choice but to become mountain bandits, and the world was filled with them. Toad Village was one of them. When the old leader was around, Toad Village was quite powerful and famous in Kin Nui Mountain. The old toad leader died not long ago, and the remaining bandits left one by one, and he believed he was the last one left. Cheng Dali sighed softly as he sat alone. Suddenly, a hand reached for his shoulder and called him a village master. It was Zhu Shenji, which surprised Cheng Dali that he hadn't left yet. Despite being the toad village strategist, Zhu Shenji's IQ was questionable, and his ideas had never been useful. Cheng Dali promptly took Zhu Shenji's hand in his and expressed his gratitude for staying behind. He stood up and went on to say that he would always remember this favor. Zhu Shenji responded, while holding Cheng Dali's hands, that he was misunderstanding something. He went on to say that the Toad Village's resources had mostly been depleted and that the only thing left was a skinny horse, which he asked if he could take because no one else wanted it. This left Cheng Dali speechless and broken inside as Zhu Shenji asked for his tiger skin too. Cheng Dali sat back in dismay and replied to take it and leave. Zhu Shenji grinned as he held onto the rolled tiger skin rug and called for Ling Er to hurry up and take the horse with them as they would be departing. Even after traveling down to the mountain, they would still have to rely on it to earn their keep. Cheng Dali sighed as he sat alone. He worried about how he would survive alone in this unfamiliar world. Suddenly, a symbol appeared behind his head, and a hand emerged from it. This hand slowly stretched for his head and smacked him, which threw him off guard and made him wonder who it was. He stood up and looked back, perplexed about where he was and the place he was in. It was a vast space with pixelated sparkles floating around. A long-haired blonde female appeared in front of him, leaving him stunned. This lovely blonde lady had a pair of diamond-shaped antennas on her head. She described Cheng Dali as a brave young man. Her cyan-colored eyes gazed at him and she went on to say that he was finally here. Cheng Dali inquired who she was and where this place was. The blonde girl replied, while a blue diamond floated in her hand, that this was the system's subspace and she was the spirit of the system. Then, the spirit of the system with this blue diamond floated above him, applauding him for opening the hearts of the mountain bandits. This blue diamond abruptly unleashed rippling energy that caused it to explode into a tremendous amount of dazzling light. As a result, a blue pop-out screen with a loading screen emerged in front of Cheng Dali. As he looked at it, he recalled playing Heart of the Mountain Bandits just before being transported to another world. The blonde girl affirmed his thoughts and responded that she was also there to help him. The Toad Village, owned by Cheng Dali, was a beginner mountain with people leaving, and its population consisted of only three individuals, its leader, strategist, and groomer. Looking at the pop-out screen, Cheng Dali was taken aback by the fact that he had obtained a system after being transported. On the screen, a mission appeared, do not let the population reach one and stop the people from leaving. If the mission fails, the system would disappear. After that, he was surrounded by a bluish aura while a mission was issued for him to complete or regret later as there would be no second chances. Then, the integration with the host continued, with Cheng Dale being penetrated by bursting light. 
The spirit of the system referred to Cheng Dale as a young boy full of energy, but the village's total population was extremely small, so he needed to stop the strategist and groomer from leaving as a new mission appeared on a blue screen, instructing him to use a sincere way to stop the groomer and strategist from leaving. Cheng Dale replied that he could try to complete the mission, but he was unsure how he might leave the system's subspace. The blonde girl chuckled and invited him to approach her. She grabbed Cheng Dale and tossed him up in the air, saying, There you go. Cheng Dale screamed, his eyes welling up with tears. Moments later, Cheng Dale sweated hard as he wondered, while his hands and knees were on the floor, whether it was all a dream. Suddenly, the spirit of the system whispered in his ears that if he failed to complete the mission, he would be killed, which made fear visible in Cheng Dale's eyes. The sun's warm rays beamed outside his home as Cheng Dale called for strategist Zhu. He hurriedly ran down to the forest after repeatedly calling for strategist Zhu and pleaded to wait for him. Cheng Dale finally regained his breath when he caught their attention and stopped walking away from him. Meanwhile, Zhu Shenji, with the lady and the horse beside him, questioned his village master if he regretted and wanted to withdraw his words. Cheng Dale got distracted and locked his focus on the lady. Zhu Ling'er placed her hand on her waist and arrogantly persuaded her father to leave. Cheng Dale blushed as he inquired about her identity with strategist Zhu. Zhu Shenji politely replied that she was his daughter, who usually takes care of the horses, and that he hadn't seen her before. While gazing at his daughter, he thought to himself that she was quite beautiful. Cheng Dale held on to Zhu Shenji, mistakenly called him father but corrected himself, then told him that he had thought of something. Without him, the village would be nothing. He went on to say that Zhu Shenji was amazing and persuaded him not to leave the village because he had worked hard for many years and contributed greatly to the village. Zhu Shenji, on the other hand, was enraged because he assumed Cheng Dale intended to die with them, but he calmly replied that he was unwilling to leave because he was old and only saw himself as a burden. However, determined Cheng Dale responded that after hearing his reply, he couldn't let him go and assured them they wouldn't go hungry as long as he lived. Cheng Dale went on to argue about which village would take them in. Zhu Shenji responded with dismay, questioning how they could survive if they stayed behind. The village master proudly replied to what he was afraid of, then proceeded to request his weapon since he was going to rob someone. He then grinned discreetly, wondering what kind of reward he would receive after accomplishing his assignment. Cheng Dale inquired about Zhu Ling'er's age and thought about his confident and handsome self. He believed in the generic man was from his past life, where the main character was typically overpowered. Zhu Ling'er was irritated as she carried an enormous axe towards Cheng Dale, making him sweat in disappointment because he had imagined a different weapon. He held the axe with both hands and showed his dismay, as he imagined himself as a giant with great muscles and an axe in his hand, wondering if he was supposed to be a woodcutter looking for trees that required some chopping. A pop-out box appeared, indicating mission completion, stopping the strategist and groomer from leaving. As a result, Cheng Dale was rewarded with an axe skill book, which was handed to him by the spirit of the system. He immediately integrated the skill into his repertoire. It was said that Cheng Yao Jin's strong axe skills came from a fairy in his dream, encompassing proper grip, accurate chops, and powerful swings. Zhu Shenji reminded his village master that going alone was dangerous, but Cheng Dale simply stared blankly at him, leaving Zhu Shenji puzzled. Zhu Shenji was surprised to learn that his village master wanted him to come along and that he would not be going alone. With the axe resting on his shoulder and a serious expression on his face, Cheng Dale asked Zhu Shenji if he had anything else to say. Zhu Shenji replied that he had nothing else to say, and they both set off, pulling the horse. A pop-out box appeared, presenting a new mission to carry out a successful robbery before nightfall. Success would grant them a chance at the lottery, while failure would result in death. With a grave expression, Zhu Shenji called for his village master. However, Cheng Dale smiled shyly and responded that he did not need to be referred to as the village master while Zhu Shenji walked behind him. Instead, Cheng Dale grinned and insisted on being called boss. As they journeyed together, they arrived at a beautiful sunset view of a mountain surrounded by lush trees. Cheng Dale raised his hand, axe in tow. With the horse rearing up on two legs, their silhouettes etched against the backdrop of a breathtaking sunset, he yelled like a cowboy. With the midst of a mountain covered with lush trees and a breathtaking sunset, a squad of armed soldiers was moving through on horseback and walking behind a carriage. One of the soldiers called to Warrior Lin as they were two soldiers leading the route in front of the carriage on their horses. He warned Warrior Lin that there were a lot of mountain bandits in the area, and that they should take caution as they were escorting the fiancé of the city lord's son while Warrior Lin was thinking about the mountain bandits as they spoke. Warrior Lin responded strongly, saying that it had been too peaceful since the escort mission began and he had been yearning for a battle, and if they tried to rob them, he would give them a taste of his spear, he added. 
Cheng Dale and Zhu Shenji stood at the edge of the mountain road, watching the sunset fade away by the minute. Zhu Shenji advised his village master that the sun was about to set and that perhaps no one would arrive, so they should retreat first and rob someone tomorrow. However, Cheng Dale was adamant to wait. A short while later, this soldier was on horseback telling Warrior Lin about their very important escort mission that because of his assistance, this had been easy to accompany the Lady of the Sioux family to Black Rock City so that he could wed the young master of the city. This would help strengthen the relationship between the Sioux family and Black Rock City. A soldier who was walking next to a carriage told housekeeper Wang about being overly cautious. Since they were working for the city lord, he proceeded by asking who would dare to harm them while the soldier standing next to him not nodded in agreement. From a distance, Chang Dale saw them and said, here they come. As Zhu Shenji counted the armed soldiers, he advised his village master that there were too many people and that they should give up and return. As Chang Dale said that he understood his feeling, Zhu Shenji cast a puzzled look as he looked behind him. However, he persisted in boastfully telling him not to worry since he would die alongside him while lifting his arm, which disappointed Zhu Shenji as he thought to himself that he did not want to die alongside him. The armed team was making its way toward the curved road. Fearfully contemplating the need to find a way to escape, Zhu Shenji started sweating profusely. Zhu Shenji uncomfortably caressed the horse's rear and told Cheng Dale that it was rather good, which left Cheng Dale, mounted on a horse, staring back at him in confusion. Suddenly, Zhu Shenji stabbed the horse on its rear. As a result, the horse screamed and cried out in pain. While Cheng Dale yelled in panic for Zhu Shenji's name from horseback, the animal accelerated wildly and its eyes welled up. Zhu Shenji announced to the armed men that the village leader of Toad Village was robbing them as they fled down towards the armed men in a panic. As Cheng Dale and his horse approached the armed men, who simply stared blankly, Zhu Shenji went on to say that those who did not want to die had to submit or run away, leaving all their belongings behind. On the other hand, Zhu Shenji silently walked away from his village master with sobbing eyes, saying that he was sorry since he still had a daughter to feed and watch grow up but he would burn some incense in his memory. However, Cheng Dale, still on his horse, was enraged and berated Zhu Shenji not only for betraying him, but also for announcing that he was attempting to rob them. He was also ashamed of the embarrassing nickname he had. When he got close to the carriage, Cheng Dale tugged the belt tied to the bridle on the horse's mouth, causing the horse to rear up until Cheng Dale managed to stop it and felt relieved. However, Cheng Dale stood on horseback in front of the armed men, speechless and sweating excessively. The armed men stared at him, and Cheng Dale thought that being killed by the system was a preferable option. A soldier reached for his sword, trying to comprehend that only one individual was attempting to rob them. Cheng Dale responded that it was a misunderstanding, slightly lifting both palms and explaining that he was not the master of Toad Village. Then, he confidently lifted his closed fist and stated that he was Zhu Shenji, a scholar, and that those who did not want to die should surrender right now and leave all their weapons behind. While the armed soldiers were speechless rather than startled that a bandit had actually come to steal from them, they speculated that he may have wished to commit suicide and believed jumping from a cliff would be a far better option. The soldiers burst out laughing. While Warrior Lin smiled beside him, Wang yelled for silence to his comrades. Considering this, Wang went on to tell Cheng Dale that he might not know who they were, and that his life was very valuable, and that he should think about his family and return to where he came from. A dainty hand reached outside the carriage window and lifted the pink curtain. A beautiful blue-eyed, pink-haired lady emerged and glanced outside the carriage. She noticed Cheng Dale on horseback. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale felt stunned and mesmerized because he had never seen such a beautiful lady before. The system spirit emerged out of nowhere above Cheng Dale and smacked him strongly to wake him up from his daydreaming and preached to him not to be a pervert. Only Cheng Dale could see the system spirit when it was outside the system subspace, despite the fact that the host's power and experience were minimal, and he had little chance of winning a head-to-head -head battle. As a reddish lump grew on Cheng Dale's head, he pleaded with her to stop whacking his head every time she showed up, while she answered that he was looking so foolish and stupid. The system spirit presented a pop-out box containing a hidden mission to rob someone's fiancé and stated that the job's level was beyond his current abilities, and that he could reject the mission. Cheng Dale deliberated carefully because hidden missions are difficult to obtain, implying that the reward would be greater as well. Cheng Dale responded with determination that if he succeeded, he would be able to have a wife, and if he failed, he would die. If he did not have the guts for such a minor job, how would he become a successful mountain bandit in the future? The system spirit was disappointed since this pervert was just lusting after someone's fiancé's body, whereas Cheng Dale accepted the hidden mission. Warrior Lin on horseback ordered his fellow soldiers not to scare him away since he had finally found a robber with guts with whom he wished to fight. Fiercely, Warrior Lin ordered them not to interfere as this would be a one-versus-one battle with him. 
His colleagues applauded for him as they finally got a chance to see Warrior Lin's strength and to witness if every rumor about him was real or not, and they requested that he not be killed in one hit so that he could flex his skills a little more. Warrior Lin assured Cheng Dale that he would not take his life. He also firmly answered not to hold back against him as the system spirit was holding onto a pop-out box of information, explaining that his name was Lin Sheyu, an ordinary spear warrior with piercing spear striking skills and the hidden attribute of becoming a great hero. Cheng Dale, also on horseback, approached Warrior Lin and said that he had slain many nameless people with his axe, then asked for his name so that he could remember it and assured him that he would not murder him, to which he replied that his name was Lin Sheyu. Warrior Lin also inquired about his identity, specifically whether he was the Toad Village Master or Scholar Zhu Shenji. Cheng Dale was caught off guard by this question, and he firmly responded with a made-up name, Yang Chun Yiwen. Warrior Lin said that among 108 cities and 13 prefectures, there is no place named Yang Chun, and his name was weird. Cheng Dale approached him, told him to stop talking nonsense, and initiated the fight. He drew his axe ferociously towards Warrior Lin and screamed that his head was his to take. Warrior Lin used his spear to deflect his strike, but he was worried when he sensed his tremendous strength as they both glared at each other. Cheng Dale swung his axe again, this time with an ablaze hit, causing Warrior Lin to tumble from his horse and drop his spear. The spear spiraled before hitting the ground, and Warrior Lin fell on his back as well. Cheng Dale continued riding his horse towards them, with an axe in his hand. This left the armed soldiers speechless. Cheng Dale sprang from his horse and kicked the carriage driver. The beautiful lady in the carriage was worried. Cheng Dale struck the horse on the ass with his chopping strike, which resulted in the horse weeping and screaming in pain, causing it to run wild as he gripped the belt to control it. They dashed towards the troops who were obstructing their path, causing them to flee. Wang yelled to chase Cheng Dale down. Some of the armed troops pursued them, yet Wang still continued to scream that if the escort mission failed, they would all be killed. Zhu Shenji kept walking until he arrived at the Toad Village before sundown and called for Ling Er. He made it inside and promptly urged his daughter to close the village door. Ling Er inquired as to why he returned alone and where the village master was. Zhu Shenji called the village master an idiot and said that if he hadn't been wise enough to run away quickly, Ling Er would never see her father again. Zhu Shenji sweated abundantly as he moaned and lamented the situation. His daughter tried to console him by telling him that dead people don't come back to life, therefore, he shouldn't be upset. Zhu Shenji clarified that he was not saddened by his death because he had such a wonderful horse, which disappointed Ling Er. He went on to say that this village was no longer safe for them to live in, and he ordered Ling Er to carefully check out and clean everything, including the garlic in the kitchen. At the same time, the armed troops on horseback were still pursuing Cheng Dale and the carriage. Cheng Dale screamed, hurry up, while clutching the horse's bridle belt. The system's spirit appeared out of nowhere above Cheng Dale and asked if he wanted to draw one because he had just completed a mission and received one lottery draw chance, to which Cheng Dale agreed and drew one now while whipping the horse's belt. The system's spirit poked fun at Cheng Dale when she asked if he wanted to whip the horse or draw the reward first, which infuriated him and he threatened to whip her. Despite this, the system's spirit remained unbothered and cute and she kept tormenting him. Cheng Dale replied that he truly wanted to draw the reward first and informed her that he was in such a situation, and that if she wanted him dead, he pleaded to just kill him, but the system's spirit only giggled and winked back at him. A lottery machine materialized with a snap of the system's spirit's finger and she began to draw. She slowly shook the lottery machine and held it in both of her arms. Meanwhile, the armed troops were still chasing and riding their horses after Cheng Dale, and Wang cursed the bandit and yelled that he would skin him alive. The system's spirit was still holding onto the lottery machine, while Cheng Dale panicked and begged her to hurry up since he didn't have much time because of those obnoxious-looking assholes hunting for his life, referring to the armed soldiers. The system's spirit praised Cheng Dale when a ball came out from the lottery machine and opened. He gained a great unknown hunter named Kin Man, which surprised him because the machine could draw in humans. As they chased Cheng Dale, he wondered where that person was now, as there were only rocks everywhere, or whether he would fall from the sky, or if he needed to make any chance. Cheng Dale chanted with his pointer finger, Go Pikachu, I choose you, while the system's soul gazed upon him confusedly. However, that didn't work. Cheng Dale kept going while gripping his axe and uttering, I summoned you in the name of the eternal useless Sekura, while the system's soul continued to stare at him in confusion. This continued further as he gestured with his hand and said, calling for backup, respond quickly, gather and create a path, shine brightly, appear in front of me, warrior, calling, calling 123, respond. 
All the while the system's spirit looked at him in confusion. Suddenly, Warrior Lin nearly struck the carriage with his spear and called for Cheng Dalei to return, since he was about to murder him, which caused Cheng Dalei's eyes to widen in fear. A figure in the distance alerted his village master not to worry because Kin Man was on his side. Kin Man, with long brown hair and an X mark on his chest, stood boldly in front of them, wielding a spear. Cheng Dalei thought to himself that the system couldn't make the reward appear out of nowhere, they had to be arranged and appear at a reasonable time. Warrior Lin on horseback leaped towards Kin Man despite his best efforts to avoid him, but couldn't stop his horse. Kin Man fiercely commanded him to get off. He drove his mighty spear into the horse's mouth, causing it to pour blood, roaring get off the horse. With Warrior Lin on its back, the horse lost its balance and fell. Then, the horse collapsed on the ground with a loud thud. Cheng Dalei was astounded by Kin Man's tremendous strength. At the same time, the armed soldiers were taken aback and left speechless. After that, Wang gulped and sweated profusely. Nonetheless, he raised his sword and said that they were men of the leader of Black Rock City, that if they didn't want to die, they should surrender and hand Miss Su over to them, or else they would gather the army and wipe this town off the map. Kin Man stood tall and magnificent as his mighty spear swung and struck the stone, which squarely hit Wang's face, causing him to lose his teeth. Kin Man shouted furiously at him to get lost. As Wang screamed for retreat, all the armed soldiers fled as they needed to report this to the leader. Kin Man approached his village master beside the carriage, and informed him that he had come to work for him. Meanwhile, the system's spirit held a pop-out box containing information about Kin Man, a great unknown hunter who, at age 31, possessed the skill of a three-core plum blossom spear. He was a hunter who lived near Black Rock City, but now he was wanted by Black Rock City, so he moved to Toad Village to work under the village master. His backstory involved living with his wife near Black Rock City. However, when the leader of Black Rock City heard that Kin Man's wife was exceptionally beautiful, he sent his men to Kin Man's house while he went hunting. Kin Man's wife ran away because she did not want to sleep with Black Rock City's leader, so she jumped off the cliff and committed suicide. When Kin Man returned, it was already too late. Enraged, he rushed towards Black Rock City and killed more than 10 guards, making him wanted in Black Rock City. After that, he decided to work for the village master of Toad Village. A few moments later, Cheng Dalei realized that this was merely a character's backstory for him. But for Kin Man, it was all real life, and living in a war-torn era was extremely difficult. Cheng Dalei was stunned when the skinny horse he had dumped returned on its own and instructed Kin Man to mount it. Both Cheng Dalei and Kin Man reached for their horses' backs. The breathtaking sunset remained with them as they headed back to Toad Village. Zhu Shenji took a string of garlic and told Ling Er to carry the pot and check if anything had been left behind. Meanwhile, Ling Er told her father that she couldn't carry any more weight than she already did. With a garlic garland around his neck, Zhu Shenji said that he couldn't carry them, but they wouldn't survive without it either. Ling Er looked back as a voice emerged and asked them if they needed a horse. Cheng Dalei and Kin Man arrived on horseback with a carriage at Toad Village, which Ling Er recognized as the village master. Zhu Shenji's eyes widened, and his mouth dropped when he realized that his village master had not died. He promptly covered his mouth, bowed slightly, and expressed his relief, as he would have blamed himself for being too useless and unable to assist him. He continued by mentioning that he didn't need to be chased away because he was a burden and would leave on his own, causing Ling Er to sob from behind. Cheng Dale looked at them and asked where Zhu Shenji was heading. He mocked Zhu Shenji by recounting how, when he attempted to rob them, he had given his name as Zhu Shenji to the armed men who were currently searching for him. This caused Zhu Shenji's mouth to drop and irritate it. Zhu Shenji, with clenched fists and a visibly sweating and trembling body, adamantly retorted that despite being elderly, he still had his brain to come up with solutions, while Ling Er sobbed behind him. He went on to explain that he would always be available to assist Cheng Dale and gave a thumbs up. Reluctantly, Cheng Dale agreed and instructed Zhu Shenji to come and help him pull the horse. He introduced Kin Man to Zhu Shenji and encouraged them to get along. Cheng Dale directed Ling Er to feed the horses, Kin Man to prepare supper, and strategist Zhu to transport the person in the carriage to his room. He winked as he announced his intention to sleep with his wife. Quietly, Zhu Shenji boarded the carriage and began moving. Right after, Cheng Dalei reflected to himself that he had completed the covert mission, but had not yet checked the rewards. Cheng Dalei then snapped his fingers to call the system. So the spirit of the system appeared above Cheng Dalei but she reprimanded him for being rude, giving him a whack. With her hands crossed, she reminded him to refer to her as the system goddess, to which Cheng Dalei agreed, sporting a reddish bump on his head. Afterward, the system goddess commended him for successfully robbing someone's fiancé. She went on to explain that his reward was the awakening of someone's hidden attributes as her palm was enveloped in golden energy. The system's goddess then stated that it was up to him to determine whose characteristics would be awakened. 
Cheng Dali was perplexed by the unexpected awakening but was interrupted. Zhu Shenji stood in front of Cheng Dali, who realized that the man's hidden attributes had been awakened. When the moon shone brightly on the Kin Niu Mountains, it was nearly dark. The defeated armed soldiers temporarily camped out with bonfires somewhere in the Kin Niu Mountains. Commander Wang asked his fellow soldier whether he wanted to live, to which his soldier replied that he naturally wanted to live. Wang pressed him once again on how many mountain bandits had attacked them earlier. His fellow soldiers were speechless as they gazed upon each other, then one of them replied that there were 100 bandits, and he was sweating heavily. Wang was upset when he heard only 100, and he aggressively refuted his fellow soldier's allegation, stating that he had seen 300 with his own eyes. As Wang sat near the bonfire, he continued his story of how they risked their lives and fought the bandits, managing to kill only some of them. He mentioned that Warrior Lin had gone missing while Miss Su had been abducted, while his fellow soldier sat silently across from him. Wang told everyone that if they wanted to live, they needed to get some wounds on themselves, which they did by wrapping themselves in bandages. Then he ordered them to follow him back to the city to request reinforcements. Meanwhile, Warrior Lin stood quietly with his spear next to the bonfire. Warrior Lin was disappointed that he had failed Commander Huang's request to oversee this escort operation, resulting in Miss Su's abduction. With apparent injuries on his face, Warrior Lin promised Huang that he would risk his life to save Miss Su. A few moments later, the system's goddess held onto the information in a pop-out box for Zhu Shenji, a famous lousy strategist at the age of 49. His hidden talent was his stupid tactics, which he suggested would only result in a loss. Cheng Dalei would fail if he listened to him. Cheng Dalei felt disappointed since he expected to be a below-average strategist, but he couldn't believe he was trash even with his hidden talent. Zhu Shenji asked his village master what was wrong with him, to which Cheng Dalei replied nothing and inquired what he wanted while scratching his head. Zhu Shenji reported that he had already talked with the lady, whose name is Su Yi, and she is the young master's fiancé of Black Rock City. He mentioned that his village master shouldn't have abducted her. He stated that the former village master had also meddled with Black Rock City and died. If their current village master were to do the same, they would face certain death if they attacked again. Linger, holding a bowl, informed her father and the village master that dinner was ready. In the dusk sky, Cheng Dalei gave the command to gather Kin Man, Zhu Shenji, and Linger to discuss the situation over supper. They gathered around and sat near the bonfire, with their supper hanging on a pole, as Cheng Dalei asked if anyone knew what was happening in Black Rock City. So Kin Man replied that he had some knowledge about it. Kin Man described Black Rock City, which is 150 miles away from Toad Ridge and ruled by Han Huji, a womanizer, ruthless tyrant with 5,000 elite troops. Zhu Shenji lamented the 5,000 versus 4 people gap and proceeded to ask his village master if he thought they could win. Cheng Dalei sarcastically replied, asking what Zhu Shenji wanted him to do, send her back, admit they were wrong, and request mercy. He asked Zhu Shenji if he believed that would work. So Zhu Shenji gave in and told him to disregard what he had said. Zhu Shenji and Ling Er looked dumbfounded, their mouths dropping, when Kin Man recommended that instead of being on passive defense, they should take the initiative to attack first because he believed they could capture Han Hu Ji with a 70% chance of winning. Zhu Shenji leaned in closer to Ling Er, suggesting that they should go because they would otherwise die. Ling Er sobbed, saying they were already dead. Cheng Dalei insisted that escape wasn't an option. He went on to explain that firstly, Black Rock City was not lacking in women, and they wouldn't attack with all 5,000 elite troops. At most, they would send 100 or 200 men. Secondly, the city was 150 miles away, and it would take them five days to travel back and forth. In those five days, they should be able to set up an ambush and win the battle. The system's goddess appeared and notified that Cheng Dalei had activated a new mission, to rely on his village and fight off the enemy attack. She added that the mission's difficulty was greater than the mountain power. Cheng Dalei went on to explain that third, his father died while fighting them, and that he must avenge him. Besides, Kin Man and Han Huji had bad blood. If they don't take revenge, how could they have the face to live peacefully? Kin Man stated that they had to secure the village no matter what happened this time, and Cheng Dalei responded that there are two ways leading to Toad Ridge. Zhu Shenji explained that the smaller road had a valley in between, so carriages couldn't use that road but the other one might be used if they were going to ambush, so they needed to know their path. Cheng Dali remembered Zhu Shenji's hidden talent for terrible tactics. If he listened to him, they would perish. So he asked him which way the enemy might take. Zhu Shenji, with confidence, chose the official road while holding a smoking pipe, while Cheng Dali already knew which road they would take. The village master kept asking Zhu Shenji if he thought they could win, which left him puzzled. Zhu Shenji then stated that he was sorry, but he believed they would be wiped out, and no miracles would happen. So Cheng Dali responded that he believed they stood a chance to win and that a miracle may occur. 
Cheng Dalei grinned as he continued, saying that even though it seemed like they had no chance at first, when he thought to himself about Zhu Shenji being useless, he merely needed to do the opposite of what he says, effectively ruling out the useless choice. A few moments later, the moon shone brightly and was partially obscured by thin clouds in the dusk sky. Someone reflected on the fact that God had not given up on her yet, and that toilet paper, used tissue paper, and torn clothes might be reused. It was Miss Su who sat on the bed alone in silence. When Cheng Dalei entered her room and encouraged her to eat something, she was surprised but remained silent. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei thought to himself that Miss Su is such a beautiful woman with a nice body. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei's alter ego had different thoughts because it desired her and could do whatever he wanted with her. The real Cheng Dalei, on the other hand, covered his mouth as he objected to his evil thoughts. He couldn't do such things with her because he was a decent guy in the past and was afraid that if he crossed that line, he would become a villain. The system goddess appeared and praised Cheng Dalei as a righteous young man. She said that because of his kindness, a new mission had been triggered, which was to win her heart without using violence. She stated that only a real man could rule the world. But first, he needed to be able to win girls' hearts by being a gentleman. Cheng Dalei offered her food, thinking that she wouldn't be able to sleep that night. He mistakenly referred to her as Ying Ying but then corrected himself and addressed her as Miss Su. He asked whether she, too, couldn't sleep that night. Miss Su asserted that her family was one of the four great families of Fallen Leaf City. She said that she would offer him gold as payment if he would allow her to go back. She went on to say that she was also the fiancé of the young master of Black Rock City, so she warned Cheng Dalei of the consequences if he harmed her. Cheng Dalei explained that there must have been a misunderstanding. He had a vendetta against the Black Rock City leader and had captured Miss Su to lure him out. He promised to set her free once everything was over. Miss Su labeled Cheng Dalei a liar and stated that men only wanted to sleep with her, claiming he was no different. Cheng Dalei stared silently as Miss Su pleaded with him not to harm her and promised to meet his needs, whether it was gold, food, or something else. Suddenly, the system goddess emerged with a pop-out box of information about Miss Su Ying, who, despite lacking talent, possessed good insight. Cheng Dalei thought to himself whether he should try to convince her. Cheng Dalei told Miss Su and stood in front of her that he knew he was only a violent bandit in her eyes. But if he could live quietly, why would he become a bandit when he also wanted to be a scholar or a warrior? He then looked out the window, where the full moon shone brightly with thin clouds and a sea of stars. He continued to say that he used to hold books in his hands and wanted to learn literature, fight like warriors, win titles, and travel the world crossing seas. However, he encountered some greedy pigs who treated others like scum. He began to wonder why the world was like this and why people were so easily swayed by greed. Miss Su sat silently as Cheng Dalei went on, saying that he wanted to save this world so that all citizens could live in peace. And right at that moment, as Cheng Dalei extended his hands towards her, he expressed how he wanted to grab her hand as he asked her if she would help him achieve his dream. Miss Su said that, although what he said could be a lie, she had the impression that he wouldn't hurt her and was perplexed as to why she had this perception. She went on to explain that Cheng Dalei could tell her whatever he wanted as long as he didn't harm her, and she would try her best to comply. But Cheng Dalei remained silent for a moment. Then Cheng Dalei sat down near the table and asked her if she could tell him more about what had happened in this world, which was likely the only sincere statement he had made since entering the room. They faced each other in the room, as Cheng Dalei was determined to learn everything about this world, including the fact that this girl was a merchant's daughter. Time had passed, and Cheng Dalei bid farewell as he cupped his fist. After that, Miss Su read a poem by candlelight, with a sword in hand, the ambitious man, to rescue the people of the occupied land. Miss Su thought about the Wu Hook, which could be a sharp weapon, Guan Shang, and where the empire with only 13 prefectures had originated from. She knew that Cheng Dalei was lying, but these words were too beautiful, and she praised such an amazing poem. She believed that if she could showcase this in the so-called talent poem meeting, it would definitely shock everyone. Meanwhile, Kin Man stood silently outside. He drew the attention of his village master. Cheng Dalei was surprised when he saw Kin Man and asked him what he was doing there. Then he thought to himself if Kin Man had a habit of listening to people's private conversations. Kin Man cupped his fist and expressed how he felt that the village master was no better than those dirty bandits. But after he heard them speak, he was deeply moved by his words. And since he had a dream, Kin Man was willing to risk his life to make it come true. Suddenly, the system goddess appeared and told Cheng Dalei that he had unknowingly achieved Kin Man's hidden mission, which was that Kin Man always had a heartache since his wife and children were taken away from him and by treating Su Ying with courtesy, he gained his trust. Cheng Dalei, with his hands crossed, looked at the pop-out screen. He thought that abducting Miss Su was actually no different from the actions of the Black Rock City's leader. So Cheng Dalei assumed that if he had hurt her, Kin Man would have been the first to kill him, realizing it would not have been so easy to gain the trust of a strong person and make him loyal. 
The dawn arrived at Toad Village, and Ling'er dashed off to inform the village master that someone was attacking their village. This surprised Cheng Dale because he did not expect them to arrive quickly, so he asked how many individuals were there. Ling'er blushed as she replied that there was just one with a spear and that he was rather handsome. Outside the Toad Village, Warrior Lin rode his horse and demanded that the Toad Village's dirty bandits come out and face their demise. He went on to say that if they had hurt Miss Su in any way, he was going to kill them all. All four of them came outside and looked for their attacker, and Cheng Dale just scratched his head and called him an idiot for coming. Cheng Dale then gave Kin Man the command to chase him away. Warrior Lin advised Kin Man as he approached him to bring his weapon and horse, assuring him that he would not take advantage of him. But Kin Man confidently replied that there was no need. Suddenly, Kin Man sprang high, trampled the horse on its head, and grasped Warrior Lin's face with his bare hands, leaving Warrior Lin dumbfounded. Kin Man then raised his hand while still gripping Lin's face with his bare hand and exclaimed that he was weak. Warrior Lin hysterically responded to get his hands off him. So Kin Man flung Warrior Lin out with his spear. As a result, he blasted past the trees while yelling that he would return. Eventually, Warrior Lin descended from the Toad Ridge. Cheng Dale felt soft-hearted and told Kin Man not to harass him and to let him take his horse back when he returned, which he promised to do because Kin Man would do as his village master said. Cheng Dale's eyes widened as he was informed that he had successfully defended the attack on the village and that the reward would be provided. The system presented him with a golden line chest, which made him question if something was wrong. He wondered if it was intended to be a difficult mission that he had finished so easily. It shouldn't have been so easy, otherwise, the system would not have indicated a higher difficulty level. Cheng Dale wondered if it could be a bug in the system. Suddenly, the system goddess handed Cheng Dale a scroll with a list of his rewards. He was rewarded with a metal spear, upgraded horses in the mountain, a healing effect within the mountain, and a random skill upgrade for one person. This made Cheng Dale feel very lucky. He was also awarded 10 farming lands, and when Cheng Dale reached for his legs, which were feeling sore from being so joyful and excited, he thought it felt like killing an ant and earning gold in return. He felt like he had won the lottery or been blessed by Lady Luck. The rewards kept pouring in with 10 wooden boxes and so on, which prompted him to ask what was wrong with the system. The system goddess stated that she was simply a spirit and that, bug or no bug, it wasn't within her control. She wouldn't be chastised for it, therefore, she recommended he take them. Outside the system subspace, Cheng Dale bowed slightly with a blank look, but he was amazed, so Zhu Shenji asked him what was wrong with him. Right after, the system goddess presented Cheng Dale with a new mission, which was to defend the village against the second attack, with the mission complexity exceeding the village's existing power. Cheng Dale sensed that the real attack was getting closer and that the rewards were only a minor consolation before the real chaos began. On the other hand, Zhu Shenji knew that his village master had gotten himself a wife, and he advised him to get a hold of himself as his legs were shaking, so Cheng Dale told him to shut up about it. Meanwhile, a spear landed on the ground as he told himself to be on guard as he was in a real life and death conflict. Lin, the warrior, was traveling over the mountains with his spear in hand. Warrior Lin resolutely stood, despite evident injuries and torn garments, and chuckled that he was back. As the warrior Lin continued to fight them, Zhu Shenji became enraged and suggested that they simply murder him this time, which enraged Cheng Dale, who branded Zhu Shenji a fool and stated that warrior Lin was their benefactor, and that whoever wanted to kill him had to first kill him. Cheng Dale continued to be friendly to Warrior Lin, asking if he was hungry, if he wanted to come in and eat something, claiming that their food tasted very good, and asking if he wanted to try it. This left Zhu Shenji puzzled. Warrior Lin stood bravely from afar, his spear thrust into the ground, yelled back to the dirty bandits not to talk nonsense and come at him, and that this time he would not use his horse and weapon, but would fight with his bare hands, while Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man not to kill Warrior Lin. Cheng Dale insisted on Kin Man being gentle and controlling his strength, which Kin Man assured his master. While standing in front of Kin Man, Warrior Lin challenged him to combat. Then, out of nowhere, Kin Man sprang promptly. He hit him with one hand, and as a result, he flew back again. Cheng Dale asked Warrior Lin if he was okay and said he would wait for him to return if his health improved. On the other hand, the system goddess appeared with a scroll of rewards for successfully completing the second defense mission, such as rewarding a mountain spring, 10 blood pills, a bonus village skill, 10 sickles, and 5 wooden boxes. However, these did not impress Cheng Dale because they were obviously mediocre compared to the first reward. Meanwhile, Warrior Lin traveled slowly on the steep route towards Toad Village with a wooden staff and suddenly triggered the third mission to defend the town for the third time. When he arrived at Cheng Dale's location, the village master asked whether he was okay, to which he answered until Miss Su was released. Warrior Lin, despite having bumps, noticeable bruises on his face, and missing teeth, insisted on never stopping and coming back. 
Shang Dale shook his head as he told Kin Man to be gentle with him. Kin Man punched Warrior Lin once more and the third defense was successfully completed, and they were rewarded. Warrior Lin reappeared again with apparent bruises on his face, which triggered the fourth mission for them to defend the village for the fourth time, and then they were rewarded. Every time Warrior Lin appeared, a mission would be triggered, and they would be awarded again after defeating him repeatedly. A few moments later, Ling Er asked his village master if they could return because she was hungry, but Cheng Dale told her to wait because he knew Warrior Lin wouldn't give in to him. The system goddess emerged with a pop-out box when Cheng Dale completed 10 defenses without any deaths, with a hidden attribute of increasing charisma for males, but being ineffective for females. The system thought that a kind-hearted person's fortune would be good because their righteousness would attract more and more teenagers who share their sense of justice. Cheng Dale questioned himself about why he had to play the nice guy card. He stood there and waited, wondering why Warrior Lin was late this time. Shortly, he sat down, believing that he would not give up easily. Cheng Dale became concerned when he thought that Warrior Lin had been attacked by some nasty individuals. He urged them to stay put while he went down the mountain looking for him. As the sun set, Warrior Lin stood near the edge of the cliff with his wooden staff, wishing to become a hero with his spear alone and save the world, while creating a peaceful world free of war. He let go of his wooden staff as he continued to be humiliated by the bandits like a frog in a well, losing not only his horse but also his spear. He cried as he vowed that he would die today and that perhaps in his next life he would become a hero whose name would be recognized throughout the Murum. While tears streamed down Warrior Lin's cheeks, Cheng Dale coughed and told him to choose one. The defeated Warrior Lin was enraged at this bastard bandit when he made a joke out of his misery. Even if he wasn't as skilled as he was, he would rather die than be humiliated by him. Cheng Dale said that he had heard what he had said and that he was an honest guy, but that a young dumb man would die for his ambitions and dreams, whereas a real man would live his ideas in a humble manner. As he listened further to Cheng Dale, this surprised Warrior Lin, who may have thought he was brave to die for his ambitions and dreams. Then Cheng Dale lambasted him and went on to say that killing oneself was not being brave. He was powerless and cowardly, and he was just trying to escape from this reality. And he yelled at him, questioning how he dared to call himself a warrior. Warrior Lin said that he didn't know and that he was simply a mountain bandit. Cheng Dale added that he knew Lin despised bandits, but he also had a dream and used to be a man full of ideas. He then inquired whether he would like to hear about his hopes and dreams. Cheng Dale continued by saying that he once wanted to learn more about literature, fight like a warrior, and win titles. A man who did not bring his Wu Hook obtained Guan Shang of 50 prefectures with a poem line like, with a sword in hand, the ambitious man, to rescue the people of the occupied land. He went on to say that he wanted to travel the world and cross seas, but then he met some greedy pigs who treated others like scum. He began to wonder why the world was like this and why people were so easily swayed by greed. Cheng Dale continued his speech, stating that he wanted to reconstruct this world and dreamed of saving it, allowing all citizens to live in peace. Right at that moment, Cheng Dale smiled and extended his hand towards him, saying he wanted to grab his hands in his and ask if he would help him achieve his dream. Warrior Lin was amazed by the words that came out of the mouth of a bandit. His eyes then drifted closed as Cheng Dale continued to inquire whether he could possibly help him fulfill his dream. Warrior Lin lost his sense of balance and was about to drift into oblivion when he questioned whether he was dreaming about how this young man, who had such a righteous dream, became a bandit. As Warrior Lin continued to wonder if his lack of insight led him to believe he was evil, he sank closer to the edge. Cheng Dale grasped Warrior Lin's hand and caught him as he passed out. He placed him down on the ground and assessed that he had serious injuries, yet he was still attempting to rescue Miss Su. A few moments later, a towel, water basin, and a bowl of medicinal soup were placed on the floor. Warrior Lin lay down with a cloth covering his body and a bandage on his head, while Cheng Dale asked Zhu Shenji if the village had any more medication. Zhu Shenji stated that he had been swept away by the gangs who had left a long time ago and questioned whether he had any fear of Warrior Lin because he could be a spy. But Cheng Dale responded that after hearing him, he felt he could trust him. Cheng Dale was concerned that if he couldn't reduce the inflammation, he would die, so he used the blood oil to treat Warrior Lin, then summoned Ling Er and instructed her to bring out the shovel and hoe. Afterward, Ling Er presented him with these two heavy tools. Cheng Dale received the materials he sought, while Zhu Shenji was perplexed as to what he would do with them. Headed by Cheng Dale, with Ling Er and Zhu Shenji, they marched to look for treasures. However, Zhu Shenji was opposed since he believed there would be no treasures remaining in the village and urged them not to destroy the land. He found the blood pill provided by the system and instructed them to feed it to Warrior Lin. At the stable, Cheng Dale informed Kin Man that the black horse would be his, to which Kin Man thanked him. 
After this, a pop-up box of information emerged, revealing that the yellow horse had an escape skill, and the black horse had a charge skill. Also, Ling Er discovered a metal spear on the road outside as she had shown to her village master. Cheng Dali got a burned copy of Zhu Shenji's black history and examined the map carefully, wondering who designed this terrible map. He discovered that it was, as expected, Zhu Shenji. Kin Man found a military drum hidden among the rocks. Meanwhile, Ling Er found a dust-covered flag under the table. Moments later, she was astounded and wondered whether it was the work of a ghost that the well, which had been abandoned for ten years, began to spew out water. Later, Cheng Dale presented the spear to Kin Man to use as a weapon. Kin Man was astounded because he had only dreamed of having an elite spear like this and that his spear skill could be upgraded to a whole new level. A pop-up box emerged, proclaiming that he was the top bandit in the Toad Village, wielding a three-core, plum-blossom spear. The system goddess appeared with a pop-up box containing a lengthy list of rewards for that day, such as a spear, common armor, blood pills, war drum, flag, wine, and sickles, map, scribe cloth, farm land, well, mountain spring, skills, upgraded horses, heal and unity. However, it disappointed Cheng Dale because there was no sword for his dream of becoming a Muram swordsman, and he felt hopeless. Cheng Dale was puzzled that he hadn't discovered the 50 wooden boxes, while Zhu Shenji lifted a small entrance hidden beneath a haystack that led to a basement. They unlocked it with a step and walked inside to find out. Finally, they found the 50 wooden boxes piled up, and as Zhu Shenji was climbing down the stairs, he asked his village master if the old master had left him some heritage. Zhu Shenji stood next to the stack of wooden boxes and asked Cheng Dale whether these were the old village master's savings, to which he answered that he wasn't sure. When Cheng Dale invited him to open them and see what was within, both of their eyeballs radiated crimson light as they smirked sinisterly. Cheng Dale washed his face with water to wipe away all the bad luck. When he opened a wooden box, a light burst out, and he remembered drawing numerous SSRs over the years in excitement of something coming out, whether it was a famous beast, beautiful girls, or legendary weapons. He did, however, acquire one box of stone, which was essentially trash, while the system goddess smiled and gestured thumbs up. Cheng Dale felt frustrated and cursed as he gazed at the stone in the palm of his hand, knowing he couldn't change his fate. Zhu Shenji offered to open one box for his village master, but Cheng Dale declined because he was certain his luck was worse than his. Zhu Shenji opened a wooden box and wondered what it contained. Cheng Dale examined it with his hand and declared it to be gunpowder, while Zhu Shenji inquired if this black substance was edible. Then Cheng Dale told Zhu Shenji to open all the boxes and see if there were any more gunpowder boxes. When they opened all of the wooden boxes, they found 10 boxes of gunpowder, 20 boxes of trash stone, and a pile of broken weapons and torn clothes, as displayed on the system goddess's pop-out box. Cheng Dale smiled as he realized they could rely on the gunpowder and mountain roads to defend the Black Rock City attack. Cheng Dale, who had already gotten out of the basement, told Zhu Shenji to keep the boxes since he still needed them. But Zhu Shenji, who was about to exit through the small basement door, offered that it would be some good wood, which they could use as firewood in the winter. He threatened to fire him if he broke any of these boxes and then inquired where the village field was. Zhu Shenji responded that it was at the back hill and had been deserted for many years and asked why he was asking about it, to which Cheng Dale replied that he wanted to go and take a look. The full moon was visible at night. Zhu Shenji complained that it was already late and asked why they were walking so far to see a deserted field, to which Cheng Dale replied to go call Kin Man and Ling Er. All of them walked past a grassy field surrounded by a stone mountain. Zhu Shenji pointed out that he threw some wheat seeds there during the spring. Zhu Shenji was doubtful that anything would grow there because it was a wasteland. But they arrived at a flourishing wheat field. And seeing it with his own eyes, Zhu Shenji was astounded. He stepped through it, saying God bless us. While Linger was being scolded for running around and perhaps knocking down the wheat sprouts, the system goddess emerged and confirmed that the ten farmlands had been accounted for. Kin Man explained that if they harvested these thousand pounds of grain, they would be able to survive the winter. He went on to say that the straws could be burned to keep warm and that they needed to harvest them quickly because the rainy season was coming soon. Zhu Shenji and Ling Er knelt in gratitude, thanking God for his grace and virtue. While Cheng Dale stood from a distance, he thought that not all bandits were evil, they were just living in a war-torn era. There were young and old people, some cultivating land for food, and sometimes they even went down to the mountain to buy living necessities. For example, these three in front of him were forced by life to become bandits. Zhu Shenji was a scholar in the village below the mountain. His greatest leisure was to earn money to buy wine and drool while staring at the widow's breasts. But there are always evil people in every world. 
One day, the bullies of the village were eyeing Ling Er, sometimes even trying to forcefully grab her. After rejecting them several times, one day Zhu Shenji invited the bully to his house. He dressed Ling Er up beautifully, brought some wine, and slaughtered the family's old hen which laid eggs. Zhu Shenji told them to look at how cute and beautiful Ling Er was, and she would definitely be able to serve him well. Zhu Shenji added that Ling Er was fortunate to be with him, and he hoped he could also be fortunate in the future. He laughed with them, helped them become an adult, closed the door, and made them feel comfortable. After the bully got drunk, Zhu Shenji chopped off his head. He burned his house and brought Ling Er along with him. After many twists and turns, they ended up in Toad Village. Perhaps that was the one and only time Zhu Shenji's scheme succeeded. But Cheng Dalei also thought that his scheme was amazing. While Ling Er and her father sat in the wheat field, gazing at the full moon, Ling Er wanted to harvest some wheat and make some pancakes for them. However, Zhu Shenji reminded her not to be extravagant and suggested that she make pancakes with elm leaves so that they could be eaten for a few days. Ling Er replied that she was hungry and wanted to go with him. But Zhu Shenji did not want to rush because of the beautiful field. Inside the toad village, Cheng Dalei was looking at a grayish flag with red stripes on it, while Zhu Shenji asked whether it was their flag, which he thought was sewn into someone's pants. Cheng Dalei responded that he had been meaning to ask who designed the flag and what the egg on top of the toad meant. Zhu Shenji explained that it was not an egg but a heavenly toad swallowing a moon. While Cheng Dalei placed his hand on the flag, he instructed Kin Man to hang it. Kin Man promptly jumped from the ground to the roof and then to the pole. After he hung it, Kin Man jumped back down on the ground and joined Cheng Dale, Su Shenji, and Ling Er. The full moon was obscured by thin clouds, yet it shone brightly as the flag waved in the breeze, and Kin Man stood looking up. Someone thought that they could survive this winter with a lot of food as long as they could successfully defend against the attack. That person believed it was his territory and he wanted to protect it. It was Cheng Dale, and that marked the beginning of his mountain village. The system goddess appeared and said that the flag was hung so that the heroes who had heard of his battles would come and become his subordinates. She delivered Cheng Dale a new mission, which was to increase the mountain's population to 100, with the reward being one lottery draw. It was a clear morning at the city lord's mansion when someone narrated how they had arrived at Toad Ridge, where there were hundreds of bandits commanded by a leader who called himself the Toad King. Commander Wang knelt in front of the city lord, with girls standing behind him, and a man sat alongside the table on the side. Commander Wang expressed his anger at their actions and how he had rushed towards them. While the city lord remained silent, Commander Wang began to sweat heavily as he explained that while they were fighting the bandits, a guy named Zhu Shenji rushed out. A man sat alongside the table inquired whether there were always so many bandits at Toad Ridge. Commander Huang sobbed as he responded that there were at least 200 people, and they called themselves Yi Wen from Yang Chun. He then lowered his arms to the ground and continued, saying that not only did he try to protect the young master's fiancée from the bandits, but he was terribly injured and allowed her to be robbed. He believed he deserved to be punished and killed. The city lord agreed and ordered him to be killed. Someone caught the city lord's attention while they were dragging Commander Wang away. A young man emerged from behind the towering red curtain and told them to wait as he pleaded with his father to allow him to lead the troops on Toad Ridge and save Miss Sue. But his father responded that she was just a bitch and that daddy would find a new one for him. This young man bowed his head with both hands, begging his father to allow him to lead the troops because he couldn't call himself a man if he couldn't protect his wife. Tea was poured into the city lord's cup, and he then asked how many soldiers his son wanted. The city lord almost spat out his tea when he heard his son say that he wanted 2,000 soldiers. A man sat alongside the table was shocked by his young master's remarks, and he responded that 2,000 soldiers would require a large consumption of food and supplies. To travel with the supplies, they would need a lot of horses and troop arrangements, and a road to choose. Most importantly, there were only about 300 bandits, and he pleaded with his young master to reconsider. But the young master insisted that he had thought of everything and that he would prefer to overwhelm them with power. While the lady poured tea for the city lord again, he explained that Black Rock City had only 5,000 men and he couldn't give him more than 1,000. The young master then demanded that he would like to have 200 cavalry, 200 archers, 300 swordsmen, 100 armored knights, and 200 spearmen. He confidently explained his strategy, cavalry could chase after bandits who would run away, archers could shoot the bandits from far away, providing support for the troops, armored knights could block the charge impact by the bandits, and the swordsmen and spearmen would attack those bandits when their ambush was blocked. It would be a piece of cake. While his son turned his back and slowly walked away, his proud father pointed out that this was expected of his son because he had a dream of leading troops to war and he could try it this time. The city lord went on to say that Commander Wang should go and redeem himself by following his son to war. Commander Wang thanked the city lord for his kindness and then bowed down. 
In his mind, he thought that having his head chopped there might not be a bad choice since there were only two bandits, and he could only wonder if the young master saw that after reaching Toad Ridge. When they left, the city lord asked the strategist by for his thoughts on his son's plan, to which he replied that in the mountains and forests, cavalry couldn't display their full potential, and since it's a long-distance travel, armored knights would not be suitable, and there was no point in using those troops. He went on to say that bandits were typically passive defenders, that overwhelming them with numbers was useless, and that the young master's plan was full of holes. But the city lord was aware of these facts and wondered why he was allowing the young master to act rashly. The city lord said that his son admired the general, that he studied the art of war, but that his skill lacked experience, and that the mountain ridge had already been attacked by them, that there would not be 300 bandits, and that he would not lose to them with 1,000 men. He went on to say that his dream was to lead troops, so let him have some fun leading the troops in this small battle, while Strategist Bai said that he was relieved that the city lord was aware of this. Strategist Bai added that the young master was preparing to lead the troops. He then asked the city lord if he would inquire about how he planned to lead them. The city lord replied that there wouldn't be an issue and requested the girls to go back to his room, as he did not want to worry about anything else and only wanted to have fun with these young girls. The city lord stood beside him with the girls and added that if strategist by ever experienced them, then he would realize that nothing else in this world was worthy of thinking about, which left strategist by speechless. Meanwhile, in the inner room of Toad Village, someone asked if Black Rock City didn't have a standing army. It was Cheng Dale, who sat with maps on the floor, asking Miss Sue who sat in front of him, why Black Rock City, with only 20,000 citizens, could manage to feed 5,000 soldiers. Cheng Dale then inquired about the times of war and how he could gather soldiers to defend the city. Miss Su responded that troops could be drawn from military households, but if the conflict was large enough, citizens would have to join the army as well. She also mentioned that Bai Han Chuan had planned to train 500 standing troops, but the plan was dropped because troops require a lot of resources. Cheng Dale then inquired about Bai Han Chuan. Miss Su said that he is the strategist, in charge of everything both inside and outside of the city, and that he is truly an amazing person. Cheng Dale then stood up, gathered the maps from the floor, and remarked on what a terrible ruler Black Rock City had. Miss Su asked him if he knew how to be a better city lord and manage the city better than him. Cheng Dale replied that he did not, and Miss Su advised them to run because there were only four of them, and they would be faced with at least 200 soldiers. Cheng Dale boldly replied that he now had five members after Warrior Lin joined them and that he planned to defend against 500 men. Moments later, Cheng Dale was at the small cottages inside the Toad Village. He asked Warrior Lin, who looked back and stood from afar, how his body was. Warrior Lin was taken aback and addressed him as the village master. Cheng Dale extended his hand as he replied to him about their ideals. For a moment, Warrior Lin was speechless. Then they joined hands and said it was for their ideals. Under the tree, where Cheng Dale sat next to strategist Zhu, who was eating his bread, Cheng Dale told him that he had an important task for him that would affect their chances of survival. Strategist Zhu answered that he should find someone else because it was such an important task. Cheng Dale proceeded, saying that this task could only be completed by him, his one and only strategist, going to Gao Fei Hu, which irritated Zhu Shenji, who asked him if he wanted him to be killed so badly while eating his bread. Cheng Dale explained that he was asking him to bring them good wine and that he wanted to inform the Flying Tiger Bandits that Black Rock City would attack Kin Niu Mountain, as well as the Dog Head Bandits, Bald Bandits, Apricot Blossom Bandits, Wild Boar Bandits, and others. Zhu Shenji questioned if they would trust him, to which Cheng Dale responded by telling him to use his brain and make up a story. Zhu Shenji responded that he was scared because the past leader had some grudge with them, but Cheng Dale assured him not to worry and that he would let Warrior Lin follow him. Both of them went head-to-head -head when Zhu Shenji preferred that his village master come along, which enraged Cheng Dale because he wanted him to put himself in danger. Cheng Dale persuaded him to go while he winked and signaled with his hand that if he died, he would take care of Ling Er in his place. His face became frightening as he threatened to paste the erotic drawing he drew onto the walls of the Black Rock City, which surprised and horrified Zhu Shenji. In a wagon, Warrior Lin was in charge of the horses and jars behind him, while Zhu Shenji sat atop a haystack, and Cheng Dale and Kin Man stood behind them. Zhu Shenji was pissed yet stayed silent as he couldn't change his situation. Warrior Lin and Zhu Shenji departed, while Kin Man questioned his village master if they would trust the strategist. He answered that it was their only choice, whether they believed him or not, it was still worth a try. A wooden box was opened and filled with gunpowder. Cheng Dale checked it, loaded with gravel and straws. He used oiled cotton lines as a fuse for the bomb trigger, and when he was done, he closed the wooden box. With a red flag, Cheng Dale carried and waved it, instructing Kin Man to toss the box of gunpowder further away as this was the last test. A huge, fiery explosion erupted on the ground. 
Cheng Dalei and Kin Man stood at the back and watched the fire emitting black smoke. Kin Man expressed to his village master that this was the breath of an earth dragon. Cheng Dalei replied that this was the art of explosion. Meanwhile, outside the walls of Black Rock City, troops gathered and formed in front of an elevated stage as the sun's warm rays shone. The young master was glad for the clear skies, as this was a good omen. However, his soldiers thought otherwise, as they talked poorly about his good omen statements. Moreover, the sunlight beamed on them, making it unbearably hot. A soldier asked his Uncle Wang if he was coming to the war when he would turn 60 this year. Uncle Wang told him to quiet down and added that they were only subjugating a few thieves and bandits, so it did not matter if he was present or not. The young master stood with his sword by his side, his hair and robe blowing in the breeze. He placed his sword against the neck of a soldier who was holding a spear nearby and inquired whether he was happy. The soldier responded with fear and confusion. The young master went on to say that he was happy for him because, in ancient times, when a famous general went to war, they would sacrifice one person. He chose him as his sacrifice. The soldier pleaded with the young master not to joke and accused him of kidding. The young master slit his throat, asking what made him thought that he was joking. As the soldier lay on the ground with tears in his eyes, he cursed for his glory. The young master stated that he would rest in peace from this day forward and that his family's name would be glorified with his name. The young master gave the command to set off with blood on his blade. Meanwhile, the soldiers stood calmly yet enraged, calling the young master an idiot. The soldiers of Black Rock City rode their horses as they headed towards the mountains. While the young master sat comfortably in his carriage with a bowl of fruits next to him and an umbrella against the heat, Commander Wang, on his horse, asked him why they weren't rushing to attack and why he was seated in a carriage. The young master cockily replied that he was not a soldier and did not need to charge into battles. The young master added that if he were to simply command his troops and only use his brain, or if he were to do hard labor, it would hinder his full potential in war, and asked him if he now understood. Commander Wang sweated profusely as he nervously replied that he understood. The young master went on to add that he wouldn't understand that he respected generals who stayed in camp and led the troops to war, while his men won the battle, which left Commander Wang speechless. A few moments later, Bai Han Chuan dashed over to the city lord, who was preoccupied with his young girls. He stood in front of him and told him he felt uneasy because the young city lord had been gone for a day and that he needed to organize a hundred men to go after him in case he was in danger. The city lord told him to do anything he pleased as long as he didn't disturb his enjoyment, to which Bai Han Chuan agreed. As soon as they received orders, soldiers on horseback began to gather, one hundred of them ready to ride their horses outside the city. Headed by Bai Han Chuan, they set off as dust billowed from their horses' hoofs. Meanwhile, it was almost dark, yet the troops of the young master of Black Rock City continued to march through the mountain. Commander Wang advised the young master to take a rest because they were about to reach the mountain ridge and had been rushing for the entire day. The young master explained to Commander Wang that speed is essential, and what if the bandits attacked them while they were resting. Commander Wang went on to explain that the soldiers were tired and that they might not be able to stand still much longer, and that some of them might not be able to hold on. However, the young master bluntly stated that his troops must be brave and have great willpower since they are heading to war and many would die. And this little fatigue is nothing compared to death, which left Commander Wang astonished and dumbfounded. A soldier on horseback approached them and informed them that there were three roads ahead, the official road, the mountain road, and the valley road in between, and asked which way they should choose. Commander Wang strongly advised him to choose the official road and to stop asking stupid questions, but in his thoughts, he urged the young master not to take the other roads. The young master opened a scroll of war and ordered them to wait for him to check, adding that even though Commander Wang thought they should use the official way, the bandits would have known that. The young master was convinced that they would set traps along the route, but he would outwit them, leaving Commander Wang stunned and enraged. Meanwhile, a bandit in the bushes sat silently and secretly watched the soldiers. He fully convinced himself that what the Toad Village said was true and that a thousand troops were on their way to wipe them out. The bandit went quickly but quietly as the moon shone brightly in the dusk skies, as he needed to report it promptly. The news had spread all around the King Mew Mountain, and all the bandits knew about it. The bandit arrived at the Flying Tiger Village and ran hurriedly inside. He reported with his fist clenched that the news was true as many soldiers came and that they did not take the official road. A man told his big brother that they don't seem to be heading towards their village as they are attacking the Toad Village. Another man added that the Toad Village only had about four to five people, and why would Black Rock City have brought so many troops for them? Gao Feihu, the village leader of the Flying Tiger, responded that if only their military strategist were here, he would wait and see what happened next. The troops of Black Rock City walked down a narrow path with a tall stone mountain in between them. 
While Cheng Dalei and Zhu Shenji discreetly looked at them from above the edge of the cliff with trees between them, Zhu Shenji informed his village master that there were at least a thousand soldiers on their way. Zhu Shenji looked at his village master and told him to withdraw because they couldn't fight them. Cheng Dalei replied that withdrawing was no longer an option because they would fight them as originally planned while the logs were tied on the brink of the stone cliff. He went on to say that when they arrived in the valley, they would drop the logs. Lin would fire the explosives, and Zhu Shenji, Kin Man, and Ling Er would toss the explosive boxes below. Zhu Shenji inquired as to why they were only blowing up one side of the valley when they could blow up both sides. Cheng Dalei responded that when people are cornered in a tough situation, they would display incredible fighting prowess, however, if they know there is a way out, they will not fight to the death. He further stated that, unlike them, they do not have a way back. Cheng Dalei was informed that they would be getting out of the area and what they should do. Cheng Dalei was sweating profusely when he instructed them to wait a minute. He was reminded once more that their cavalry had already moved out of the line of fire. Cheng Dalei screamed to do it now as he swung his axe at the rope linked to the logs. As soon as the rope was cut, the logs were released and started to fall over the mountain. As the logs struck the troops, they screamed and fell to the ground with their horses. Cheng Dalei ordered Warrior Lin to light it, however, he hesitated while holding a fiery torch in his hand. Warrior Lin was seen trembling and sweating profusely as he remained still. When Cheng Dalei put his hand on his shoulder and inquired if this was not his very first killing, he answered that there were simply too many people present down there. Then Cheng Dalei became enraged. He pushed him against the tree with both hands while calling him a bastard. He sweated profusely as he yelled at him that this is war, it's not a child's playground, and war is never about being dignified or civilized. He screamed angrily that war is when you want to kill someone and someone wants to kill you. Warrior Lin was taken aback by his remarks. Cheng Dalei grabbed the torch and added that they would all die if they let them go today. From both above and below the stone mountain, there were even more explosions. As a result, boulders began to drop from the sky. As they glanced up at the falling rocks, they frightened the Black Rock City soldiers. While the explosion continued and rocks fell to the ground, someone yelled that the exit was blocked and informed the village master that dozens of horsemen had already managed to make it out of the pass. The soldiers were terrified because they believed they were surrounded by a mountain-haunting ghost. Another scorching explosion erupted from the ground, burning the soldiers as a result of its impact and causing them to go flying. While the boulders kept falling, some ran hastily. As dust and smoke rose from the ground, a swordsman soldier screamed and ordered his comrades to rush over to the hill. Kin Man rode his black horse and declared that he would hold them off, while Chang Dale thought to himself that although a small portion of their army had made it to the side, it would still be difficult for them to defend against them. Nevertheless, he agreed to Kin Man's plan and ordered him to hold them off while Zhu Shenji would light the pre-buried explosives and drive them away from the first line. Cheng Dalei commanded Ling Er and Warrior Lin to continue throwing explosives at them. A black horse thudded to the ground. It was Kin Man riding his black horse in front of the swordsmen and spearmen soldiers who had been assigned to kill him. Kin Man fearlessly faced them with his spear and told them his name, warning them not to pass. As the troops approached, he unleashed an enormous strike with his spear, causing the soldiers and their horses to come crashing down. Kin Man continued to attack them with his spear, which shocked them. He fearlessly told them that they were not allowed to pass as he pierced his spear into the chest of a swordsman on horseback. The soldier spat blood from his mouth with a thought on his mind, if they were allowed to rest a bit, the outcome of the battle would be different, as he was feeling so tired. A few moments later, while the shattering explosion persisted and rocks fell down, soldiers hurriedly ran away from the narrow road. The fiery explosion erupted behind them, and someone yelled for their escape. Some were unable to avoid the explosion, and as they collided with it, they spewed black smoke. The remaining soldiers ran hurriedly out and reported to the young master, frightened, that there were monsters. The young master stood up in his carriage as he witnessed the blazing explosion and the black smoke it produced, while his soldiers ran away from it. However, the young master gestured his hand and forcefully commanded that no one was going to run away, and that those who would try to cross that line would die. The young master was convinced and thought in his mind that he was so handsome he would turn the tide of this losing battle into victory. His frightened soldiers explained to the young master that there were ghosts on this mountain. Most of his soldiers became enraged as they raised their fists and questioned why he wouldn't let them leave, despite the fact that they continued to run away with their weapons in their hands. The young master's eyes widened. He stood up and roared at his soldiers to go to their graves, but they ignored him and continued to run past him. The wheel of the young master's carriage broke. As a result, the carriage tumbled to the ground because it was out of balance. The young master stood up and saw the mayhem of his soldiers being flung apart along with the stone debris that resulted from the impact of blazing explosives. Commander Wang yelled at his young master, urging him to flee because they had failed and lost momentum, but they could still escape before the bandits caught up with them. 
The young master agreed that he needed to escape since he believed that in ancient times, great generals would improve through their defeats and gain experience for future battles, while his soldiers wept in fear as they ran away. While stone debris flew casually at him, the young master stayed calm as he raised both his hands and bestowed his sword upon Commander Wang, saying he would be honored to see his growth after this war. On the other hand, a rock landed on Commander Wang's head. But he didn't mind because he was annoyed with the young master, to whom he was supposed to be grateful. Commander Wang felt annoyed by the comments he had made, which left him speechless. Commander Wang pushed the young master onto his back and cursed him to die, which shocked the young master. He referred to the young master as an idiot and told him to go and die by himself as he ran away to save his own life, leaving the young master alone. Meanwhile, on the cliff's edge, Cheng Dali knelt near the ground, hunched and looked down, unsure of whether they had won. While he thought in his mind that once a single person had lost motivation and started running, the others would also panic and run away, causing a domino effect. Zhu Shenji eagerly informed his village master that they had won. Cheng Dali stood to his feet and raised his hand, commanding warrior Lin and strategist Zhu Shenji to follow him to the battlefield. They hopped on the carriage, with Zhu Shenji controlling the horse, Cheng Dale and Warrior Lin standing on the carriage with their weapons in hand, and Cheng Dale ordered Ling'er to begin banging the drum. Ling'er grasped the stick and banged the round drum with passion. The carriage drove onto the battlefield as they chanted to charge and kill them all. They arrived at the scene to find Kin Man fighting alone against numerous soldiers on horseback. Cheng Dale screamed with all his might that those who didn't want to die would be spared if they got off their horses now because he only needed their horses. While Kin Man proceeded to beat them alone, despite being pursued by numerous soldiers, another soldier yelled in fear for his ally to run. Other troops had already fled on foot, leaving their horses behind, while Kin Man continued to poke his spear at them. Cheng Dale, his troops, and the horses stood behind as they watched the soldiers run away. Cheng Dale ordered Zhu Shenji and Kin Man to bring the horses back to the stable, and Warrior Lin to follow him since they were robbing some great swords. Meanwhile, another group of armed bandits gathered and lurked near the battlefield of the Stone Mountain's narrow pathway, which was engulfed in the blazing flames of the explosion and emitted dark smoke. It was the Flying Tiger Bandits. While his comrade questioned how the Toad Village could withstand the assault of 1,000 warriors, leaving his village master dumbfounded. Shortly after, the village master of the Flying Tiger Bandits, Gao Fei Hu, responded, saying he too knew nothing and that they might have gotten some help from an expert. His comrade sighed as he couldn't believe the world was so unpredictable that even 1,000 soldiers could lose against five people. While beside him, another comrade scolded him to stop sighing as he was a mountain bandit and should not forget his job. Their village master, Gao Fei Hu, along with his sword, ordered his brothers to charge with him as they were about to rob them. The flying tiger bandits slaughtered the soldiers and demanded that they hand over their weapons. They pushed the soldiers to the ground and were ecstatic with their loot. Someone stated he hadn't changed shoes in years and requested the soldiers' boots since he needed them. They stripped them and removed their pants. One of the soldiers begged that he was not gay and that he could offer the bandit anything but his virginity, and the bandit cursed him as he responded that he did not want his virginity but only wanted his pants. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale with his axe on horseback ran after the terrified young master of the Black Rock City, demanding to give him his sword. Still, Cheng Dale pursued him with his axe and demanded that he stop running. A loud horse's stud was heard. An immense line of soldiers on horseback arrived at the stone mountain, creating a loud stud. Cheng Dale came to a halt on his horse after hearing the sound of synchronized clopping of groups of horses, which led him to believe that a group of elite troops was nearby. The leader commanded his troops to swap their spears for swords. Cheng Dale and his horse hid in the bushes as he observed the leader, who had such a strong aura. He pondered whether they could be part of the reinforcements but was perplexed as to why they had arrived so quickly. It was the strategist Bai Han Chuan of Black Rock City who came with reinforcements, and the young master raced furiously toward him, complaining that he had been bullied and all his soldiers had abandoned him. However, strategist Bai thrust his sword into the young master's throat causing the young master to mouth please for him to spare his life. As the young master knelt on the ground, he bled. Strategist Bai ordered his soldiers to pick up his corpse because they would be heading back. A pop-up box appeared, containing information about Bai Han Chuan provided by the system goddess, such as the fact that he is a top strategist with a small reputation and fame, age 52, possessing the skill of seven sword slashes, and no hidden attributes. While reading this information, Cheng Dale reflected to himself that while Kin Man may be a bandit who could fight 1,000 people at once, a top strategist is in a different league. Strategist Bai suspected that something was lingering in the bushes, prompting Cheng Dale to hide in the bushes. Strategist Bai ordered them to go back. 
This made Cheng Dalei ponder why they were leaving and speculate that, unlike Zhu Shenji, this era has some great strategists. He kicked a stone with his foot and cursed them for taking the sword with them, which he had his eye on. A pop-up box emerged for a mission that successfully completed their 11th defense and rewarded one lottery draw, asking if he wanted to draw now. The system goddess also emerged with ghostly vibes, stating that she had finally come out of that torturous small black room and that she did not want to go back in there again. Cheng Dalei questioned this because she had been so energetic before. With weeping eyes, the system goddess lamented that she had been standing in front of him, but he had only noticed her physically and that she hadn't given him any missions or talked to him about them. Cheng Dalei irritably said that he didn't care because all she did was hit him whenever she came out, and that he felt better when she wasn't there. The system goddess kicked Cheng Dalei on the head and scolded him for locking her up in that small black room. Still irritated, Cheng Dalei reacted by asking whether he could use bugs the next time. As she ran with a large wooden gavel, the system goddess cynically asked what did he think while Cheng Dalei chuckled on his horse. The Kin New Mountain map contained the locations of Black Rock City, the Doghead Bandits, the Flying Tiger Bandits, the Wild Boar Bandits, the Apricot Blossom Bandits, the Bald Head Bandits, and the Toad Village. Black Rock City's first attack had spread around Kin New Mountain. The Flying Tiger Bandits are the closest to the war area, so they attacked first. The incident would be reported to the leader of Black Rock City by the military advisor of the city. It is anticipated that his son's death would be a major event. Langer cheerfully rode a white horse in the clear morning sky, calling out to her father that it looked like a dream, while Kin Man grinned silently behind her. Zhu Shenji told Langer to prepare the horses for the ride back to the village while he gathered swords. Langer agreed with her father and mentioned how much she liked the white horse. A horse stud approached Zhu Shenji, referring to him as Old Man Zhu, and sought his attention. Gao Feihu, the flying tiger's leader, along with his numerous bandits, asked him if they could feed all the horses they had robbed. He continued to say that he would assist them in lessening their burden. This startled and shocked Zhu Shenji when he saw the leader of the flying tiger head. He replied that it was rare for him to see him there and that he woke up early. Gao Fei who went on to say that they made a fortune while they only earned a little profit. He nonchalantly mentioned how they were going to split these horses and that he needed to speak now, which worried Zhu Shenji. Ling Er frankly told them that they snatched these horses by their own abilities and asked why should they give them up. Despite being urged to shut up by her own father, Ling Er rebelled discreetly. Zhu Shenji responded that everyone worked hard and they all earned a lot of profit. However, Gao Fei who disagreed, they earned a lot, but he did not think that they earned more than them because they took most of the profits. Another bandit from the Flying Tiger on horseback yelled as he suggested to his leader, Gao Fei Hu, to stop talking to him. He continued to say that they should stop asking them to split the profit when they could simply snatch everything from them while charging towards them with swords. He demanded that he wanted that white horse. The horse was knocked off balance after being struck on the head. It was hit in the head with an arrow and eventually fell to the ground, while the man riding it became dizzy and couldn't see anything. Some of the flying tiger bandits were astounded by the amazing archery skills, while others were concerned for their second master. Kinman drew another arrow and prepared to shoot it as he fiercely informed them that if they took another step, they would die. He aimed the arrow at them while Gao Fei who questioned whether the Toad Village intended to start a war with him. Gao Fei who then firmly suggested splitting some of the profit with them because it was a significant profit, and sarcastically asked if they planned to keep it all for themselves. They remained mute and silent, resembling the horse with an arrow in its head and the second master who lay on the ground. Shortly after, Cheng Dali arrived on horseback. He asked how they should split it while resting an axe on his shoulder. His troops were surprised when he called for their village master. He rode his horse toward the flying tiger bandits, who murmured that he was the son of the former toad village leader, and that they had heard he was trash, but upon looking at him, he seemed different from the rumors. Gao Fei who thought to himself that Cheng Dalei was surrounded but remained calm and wondered if he had a hidden trump card. Cheng Dale proceeded to ask if they wanted to split the profit and suggested a simple solution. He argued vehemently that if he killed all of them there, they wouldn't have to worry about splitting anything. His statements upset a flying tiger bandit who yelled at him and condemned him as a kid trying to act arrogant while surrounded. Another flying tiger bandit added that even his father wouldn't dare to speak back to them in such a manner when he was alive, so he asked what made him think he could. Then all armed flying tiger bandits became enraged and yelled to kill him. However, an unfazed Cheng Dalei yelled back and cursed at them. Cheng Dalei pointed at them and asked if there were 1,000 of them in there. Gao Fei who replied, questioning whether it mattered if they had 1,000 men in there or not. Cheng Dalei fiercely replied that if they were less than 1,000, then he wouldn't have enough men to kill. His sinister smile appeared as his eyes turned red, and he went on to say that he had already killed 1,000, questioning if it would matter to him if he killed another 1,000. 
Everyone was taken aback and terrified. Gao Fei who thought to himself that the Toad Village only had four to five people and wondered why 1,000 soldiers had escaped in fear. He then pleaded with Cheng Dale to calm down, as they were not there to fight. Gao Fei who, his fist clenched, respectfully asked how he had done it. Cheng Dale chuckled loudly on his horse, causing some bandits to feel insulted as they gazed silently. He gestured with his index finger and claimed to have a divine technique. Then he raised his hand and claimed he could summon thunder. The flying tiger bandits looked up in anticipation as Cheng Dale lifted his hand and pointed to the sky. The sky was clear and the sun was shining brightly. Cheng Dale repeated saying he could summon thunder while pointing at the sky, leaving the flying tiger bandits puzzled and speechless. He wondered if Warrior Lin could hear his words and urged him to hurry up. At this point, the flying tiger bandits were furious at him, calling him a lying kid and daring him to trick them. Despite this, Cheng Dale persisted and yelled the word thunder again as the armed bandits charged towards him to kill him. Suddenly, a loud and fiery explosion erupted, sending stone debris flying everywhere. The debris struck some bandits on the head, shocking them. While Cheng Dale maintained his composure deep inside, he was terrified yet relieved that everything ended nicely. He then ferociously demanded if anyone else wanted a taste of his thunder. This terrified the flying tiger bandits and left them stunned. Even before civilization developed, people had been praying to different gods, burning some yellow papers and throwing them into the well to make the water holy. It was an era filled with many believers, and Cheng Dale's performance was impressive enough to make them believe in him. Even Gao Fei who was terrified, but he remained calm and thought in his mind that if that thunder had struck him, he would have died. He believed that Cheng Dale used the thunder spell to fend off 1,000 soldiers, which is why they ran. Cheng Dale continued pointing his finger as he commanded them to move aside and make way for him, threatening that they would taste his thunder if they didn't comply. The flying tiger bandits screamed as they scrambled to move aside while Cheng Dale strode past them, repeatedly chanting the word thunder. Suddenly, Gao Fei who asked him to wait. Cheng Dale sweated profusely, thinking that he had been exposed. Cheng Dale looked back and calmly asked what he could do for Gao Fei Hu, to which he replied that he had so many horses and questioned if they could feed them all. Cheng Dale sarcastically replied that even if they couldn't feed them, they could still eat them while riding back to the village with horses and loot on their carriages. Meanwhile, it was night, and the crescent moon was obscured by thin clouds at the city lord's mansion. In a candlelit room, the city lord was still busy in his bed, surrounded by young ladies, with a liquor in his hand, and a fruit bowl on the side. As soon as strategist Bai entered his room with the corpse of the young master and its blood dripping onto the floor, he called the city lord repeatedly. He kneeled down and placed the corpse of the young master on the floor, explaining that the young master was ambushed and killed by the bandits. The city lord was startled as he got up, and his eyes widened. He stood up, and his body trembled as he shouted for his son. The city lord wept as he hugged his son. Strategist Bai knelt down quietly. Suddenly, he stroked his sword and unleashed a purple electrifying seven sword slash that struck the city lord on his chest, causing blood to drip from it. The city lord collapsed but quickly rose, realizing that strategist Bai had killed his son, while he placed his palm on his bloody chest. Strategist Bai admitted that he did kill him. His sword had a purple electrifying aura as he charged towards the city lord and complained that he had sat on the throne for too long. Strategist Bai stroked the city lord again, but he dodged while strategist Bai went on to say that it was now his turn. The city lord grabbed a long torch and asked why. While they continued fighting, Strategist Bai explained that this was an era of war and it would become more chaotic in the future. Strategist Bai went on to say that the empire was weakened, and many heroes around the world were waiting for a decisive move to conquer the world. However, that city lord had become a useless man who had no ambition and simply enjoyed things such as alcohol, meat, and females. He repeated that he was useless and he would take the throne, while the young ladies on the bed sat terrified. Strategist Bai's remarks came as a shock to the city lord, as he was going to take the throne and conquer the world. The furious city lord struck back at him and reminded him that he was just a woodcutter back when he was at war with the Ring clan, and had only read a few useless books. He raised his hands and smashed right through Strategist Bai as he questioned him, daring to go against him. If he had not helped him back then, he would not have become the person he was right there. The torched head broke, and strategist Bai moved back while the city lord went on to say that even if the empire was weakened, he would still be unable to take the throne. Strategist Bai got down while his chest spilled blood as he coughed and responded that he was ashamed. That was expected of the man who kept the city safe for 37 years. The seventh tiger nickname was well deserved, and he was talented. The city lord, with a tall staff in his hand, continued to say that strategist Bai was only his dog. If he couldn't be a good dog, then he had no need for him. 
he told him that even guarding the city for one month would be difficult with his skills. He added that he had slept with more women than the number of people he had seen, and the people he had killed could fill a river. He claimed that Strategist Bai was just a frog in a well. Both Strategist Bai and the city lord screamed furiously as they continued to charge and strike each other hard. Suddenly, a dainty hand appeared from the young ladies and held back the city lord which stunned him. A young lady poked a pin into the city lord's side, and he screamed as he looked back at them. Then, strategist Bai pierced his sword into the city lord's chest, causing blood to spill from it. He screamed and then plummeted to the ground, while strategist Bai stood in front of him with his blood-dripped sword. Strategist Bai knew he could not become a good city lord, but he still wanted to try. On the ground with blood spilled, the city lord murmured about something black. Strategist Bai mockingly asked what it was. Strategist Bai went near him as the city lord murmured in his dying breath about the Black Rock City, the kingdom's gateway. He warned not to let it be invaded by the Ring tribe, as the world would be in chaos. This left Strategist Bai speechless as he stood up. He left the candlelight near the curtain as he bid farewell to the city lord. That night, the city lord's mansion was set on fire. The warm sun rays beamed on the wheat field of Toad Village, while Zhu Shenji berated his village master for stopping lazing around because they needed to harvest the wheat quickly before the horse they stole would starve. A basket full of wheat was placed on the ground while birds ate the remaining bits. Cheng Dali gave up and said he couldn't do that anymore because he was tired. The wheat needed to be slashed in order to be harvested. Sweaty and exhausted, Warrior Lin couldn't believe a warrior like him would do such a thing. While Cheng Dalei sat and leaned on the rock, complaining that his stomach hurt, he couldn't use his strength since he didn't have any energy left. Zhu Shenji loaded the wheat onto the carriage while continuing to lecture his village master to stop being lazy, as he had already used that excuse yesterday. Cheng Dalei held his head and complained that his head hurt as he approached Zhu Shenji, but this did not work with him as he continued to scold his village master to stop lazing around, explaining that if they waited for the sun to dry up the wheat, it would snap at the slightest touch and they would lose a lot of harvest that year. A red beetle appeared in the field, just like an idea that arrived to Cheng Dalei, reminding him that he hadn't robbed anyone in the past few days and he should not forget his identity as a bandit. While Warrior Lin ran after his village master to follow him and help him out, which left Zhu Shenji stunned as he stood behind. A few moments later, some poor villagers were trekking deep within Quinui Mountain when a son asked his dad whether there were any bandits nearby, to which the father replied that if he was afraid of bandits, he should forget about getting a wife. Headed by their dad, they decided to sell the firewood and buy a donkey so that they would have something to show when asking for marriage. Their dad looked back and asked them if they didn't dream of owning a horse, as now their wish could be fulfilled. While Warrior Lin and Cheng Dalei lurked behind the trees, the son argued with his father that horses and donkeys are different animals. His dad asked what the difference was between them, while Cheng Dalei and Warrior Lin jumped towards them. The dad and his sons were scared, and their jaws dropped. They promptly kneeled down with their firewood beside them as they begged for mercy, hoping to be spared. This made Cheng Dalei question why they were kneeling and told them to stand up. Cheng Dalei was pleased when he heard that they wanted to buy a horse. The dad explained that he couldn't afford a horse and planned instead to buy a donkey because his eldest son couldn't find someone to marry. Once they had a donkey, they could ask the matchmaker to find a bride. Cheng Dalei laughed and replied that they were lucky because he sells horses. He asked them if they were excited, happy, or felt fortunate. The dad replied that they did not have much money, to which Cheng Dalei asked how much they had. The dad's hand trembled as he showed his two copper coins. Cheng Dalei received the coins and then inquired if there was anything more. The dad responded that they had four wild vegetable breads that their mother baked for them to eat on their journey, and Warrior Lin received one of the wild vegetable breads. Cheng Dalei asked how the taste was when Warrior Lin ate it, and it tasted good. Warrior Lin leaned in close to his village master and whispered that two copper coins and four wild vegetable breads were insufficient for a horse. Cheng Dalei replied that they needed to sell the horses or they would have to kill and eat them. While the dad anxiously waited for them, Cheng Dalei proposed that they be kind and sell it to them, doing some good deeds for the poor. Warrior Lin verified that he was going to sell it to them, and Cheng Dalei agreed. Cheng Dalei informed them that he would give them a discount because they were his first customers. He also instructed them to follow him back to the mountain. The dad kneeled down and cried as he pleaded for mercy, begging Cheng Dalei to spare his children and offering to take him instead, as they still needed to give their Lai family license. Cheng Dalei put down the axe head on the ground near the dad, which frightened him. He addressed them in a terrifying tone, asking if they wouldn't follow them. The weary dad and his sons followed Cheng Dalei as he ordered Warrior Lin to take care of their customers. His son asked his dad if they would kill them, to which his dad, who sweats profusely, told him not to be a coward. However, his son pointed out why his legs were shaking. His weary dad explained that if they wanted to kill them, he would risk his life to stall them while his sons would run away. They arrived at the end of the steep slope of Toad Village, and his dad told his sons to be prepared to run. 
Cheng Dali told them to go up the mountain while gesturing upward with his hand. The poor villager dad told them that he would risk something but got interrupted when warrior Lin asked him what he would risk. At the stable, Cheng Dale leaned on it as he questioned them for a fight and told them to quickly pick a horse first. Cheng Dale asked them how many horses they wanted, which surprised the poor villagers because he was actually selling horses to them. He assured them that one would suffice. Cheng Dale responded subtly angrily that they had wasted his time and only wanted to buy one. The poor villager dad asked, confusedly, what about two? The sons smiled in excitement when they heard Cheng Dale question why only two and offer a horse for each of them since he had three children. However, their dad responded that they couldn't feed four horses, which made his son's jaw drop in disappointment. Cheng Dale agreed that two horses would do and asked them if they knew how to harvest wheat. His sons were nevertheless unhappy as their dad expressed that they had some farm job experience. Cheng Dale told them that if they could harvest a field of wheat before sunset, he would let them take two horses. Under the beaming sun and clear skies, Cheng Dale ordered Warrior Lin to give them the equipment, which was a sharp scythe, and brought them to the field. Ling Er, with a bowl of food, headed to his father, while Zhu Shenji stood by the carriage full of wheat and berated his village master, saying that he was becoming lazy again. Cheng Dali sat under the shade of a tree, slurping on his water bottle next to the basket of wheat, and disagreed with Zhu Shenji's remarks, stating that he worked hard, asking if he didn't see it. In Cheng Dali's mind, he was delighted that Toad Village was like a small family. Kin Man is a strong warrior, and Warrior Lin is a reliable younger brother. Ling Er is a good worker. He also had an unmarried prisoner, and he just needed a wife. Zhu Shenji obviously seemed like a grumpy old grandpa, while Ling Er happily sat on the carriage full of wheat. He kind of liked this place. Warrior Lin also sat comfortably on the other carriage full of wheat. In the field, the poor villagers kept harvesting the wheat. The son asked his dad whether they would really give them the horses, to which his dad replied that he thought they really meant it, and if they did not finish it before sunset, they would kill them. The sky turned fiery orange as the sun set, and the poor villager inquired if they wanted help grinding the wheat as well. Cheng Dale denied it, saying there was no need for it and let them go to pick two horses. Cheng Dale, Zhu Shenji, and Warrior Lin stood behind and watched them leave with two horses, while the son of the poor villager was excited when he asked his dad if he was dreaming. The bandits were letting them take two horses back home. A fiery orange sunset beamed as the poor villagers continued talking while they walked away. They expressed that bandits were good people. They gave them these horses because they pitied them. They also mentioned that the bandits even harvested wheat and expressed why wouldn't they. They found it unbelievable that not only did the bandits harvest wheat, but they also ate wild vegetable bread. They expressed that they were truly gods. Cheng Dale, Zhu Shenji, and Kin Man sat by the bonfire under the blue gradient sky with the ethereal glow of the full moon when Warrior Lin arrived with another soldier, who notified their village master that someone wished to join them. Cheng Dale questioned who it was. Cheng Dale looked at the soldier and recognized that he was that escort guy. Commander Wang narrated how his life had been very miserable and painful for him. The day he escaped death, he ran back to Black Rock City but discovered that the city lord had died and strategist Bai Han Chuan was fighting with the city lord's loyal guards, killing anyone related to the city lord. Commander Wang continued to say that he didn't know if he was considered a close person to the city lord, but he thought strategist Bai Han Chuan would not let him off easily, so Commander Wang decided to escape to Fallen Leaf City. Then, coincidentally, he met Warrior Lin, who was planning to rob someone and suggested that he should join Toad Village. Cheng Dale asked whether he was saying strategist Bai Han Chuan killed Han Huju and became the city lord himself. Commander Wang affirmed, and he added that strategist Bai was spreading rumors that Cheng Dale had killed Han Huju and claimed that he would avenge Han Huju by killing Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale was appalled when he responded that strategist Bai Han Chuan was so shameless, that Toad Village only had five people, and how could they send people to kill him? Commander Wang responded that he didn't expect only five of them. But strategist Bai publicized that there were 1,000 bandits in Toad Village, that Cheng Dale was killing people for pleasure, and that Toad Leader was the most ferocious bandit who ate human flesh as an everyday meal. He also put up a wanted list on the city's bulletin board, offering rewards for his head. Cheng Dale asked tenaciously how much his reward was. Commander Wang replied that Cheng Dale's head was worth 50, which disappointed him. Commander Wang went on to say that Zhu Shenji had 35, which surprised Zhu Shenji that he had won too, and the black-faced man was worth 30, to which Kin Man responded that it was such a pity he couldn't kill Han Huju with his own hands. Cheng Dale was apparently irritated that they were looking down on him and had only put 50 on his head. The currency used in their era was copper coins. 1,000 copper coins could be exchanged for a single silver coin, which was roughly 1,000 in Cheng Dale's previous life. The living expenses of an ordinary farmer were only 3 to 4 silver coins per year. 
Cheng Dalei turned his head to Zhu Shenji and asked how much Gao Fei Hu's head was worth. Zhu Shenji replied that he thought there was a bounty of 180 on him. Cheng Dalei replied with determination that he would definitely overtake him. On the other hand, Commander Wang wondered in his mind whether it was a good thing to have a high bounty. Warrior Lin chimed in, asking his village master if he might let Commander Wang join them because he was so sincere. With his fist clenched, Commander Wang Sanyuan said that he would like to join them. The system goddess appeared and stated that Commander Wang appeared to be a general but was actually a butler, so others referred to him as Butler Wang. She held a pop-out information box stating that his name is Wang Senyun, a slightly popular butler, at the age of 43, and he possessed no skills or hidden attributes. Cheng Dale asked him if Toad Village was good enough for him, to which he replied that it was. Cheng Dale then questioned him about why it was good. Cheng Dale went on to say that judging by his attitude, he was looking down on them, and that even if they were a small bandit village, each of them was equivalent to a hundred soldiers, which left Butler Wang speechless. Zhu Shenji assured him that Cheng Dale was strict, but Cheng Dale continued that if he really wanted to join them, he would write him a 5,000 word application letter, and then he would decide whether or not to recruit him. This shocked Butler Wang, who complained about the 5,000 word requirement and asked if he wanted to kill him. Cheng Dale said that if he believed this was hard, how else was he going to show his sincerity? and how would it be beneficial for them? Butler Wang closed his eyes as he handed the village master a treasure map. He extended his hand and offered him a document, wondering if this would demonstrate his sincerity. Cheng Dali reached for it as he inquired about what kind of treasure map it was. Butler Wang said that the city lord treasured this map, but he stole it when escaping Black Rock City. While the map was in Cheng Dali's hands, Butler Wang continued to say that 30 years ago, they were attacked by bandits. While chasing them away, they acquired some valuables. They couldn't bring so many valuables with them, so the city lord hid those treasures in different locations. This map shows the locations of those valuables, added Butler Wang. Cheng Dali sat and opened the map, inquiring about the treasure locations on the map. Butler Wang replied that he didn't know. Looking at the map, Cheng Dale became perplexed because he did not know which Butler Wang was referring to. Butler Wang said that if anyone knew about it, the treasure would have already been dug out. Cheng Dale thought to himself that there were no words on the map indicating the specific position, only a depiction of a mountain and a river, so he wondered who would know where the treasure was. Cheng Dale said that the map seemed interesting, but Butler Wang still needed to prove his worth. Now that he thought about it, his clan was going through a crisis. If he resolved that crisis well, he would accept him into his toad village. Butler Wang reflected in his mind that no one had ever warned him that being a bandit was so hard. He asked Cheng Dale what he wanted him to do. When Cheng Dale explained that they had stolen many horses, Zhu Shenji and Butler Wang were puzzled. Butler Wang verified that Cheng Dale was saying the horses were a burden. Then he proposed they sell them to the merchants in Fallen Leaf City or to other bandit clans. Cheng Dale was glad to hear that it was a good idea and asked Zhu Shenji if he had been listening, to which he replied that he had. Zhu Shenji sighed, wanting to suggest this brilliant plan, but Butler Wang had already mentioned it. He tapped Butler Wang on the shoulder and gave him a thumbs up as Cheng Dale applauded him for his smart thinking. Cheng Dale thought of him as someone who could adapt quickly and keep up the good work. Butler Wang smiled and thanked Cheng Dale while contemplating why he was motivated by the remarks he had made. A few moments later, inside the wooden walls of the Flying Tiger Village, surrounded by lush woods, there was a brown horse with an eye patch. Lauer was told that his horse had gone blind, that they couldn't use him in wars, but that he might be used for breeding, and that he shouldn't be sad because he would find him a good horse. Lauer was thrilled to hear that from his big brother, Gao Fei Hu, who was also the village master, and asked if he was going to give him his horse, to which he replied that he was only overthinking. Several knocks were heard on the gate as great news was proclaimed, surprising the bandits of the Flying Tiger Village. Gao Fei Hu was asked if someone was attempting to invade their village, to which he answered and convinced them to go along with him to look into it. Many posters were hung on the trunks of the trees outside the Flying Tiger Village. Cheng Dale was waiting in the bushes with Warrior Lin and asked him whether he was finished pasting, to which Warrior Lin ignored his questions and notified his village master that the bandits had come out. Warrior Lin added that he was done and asked about himself. Cheng Dale replied that he, too, was done and urged him to head over to the next village. Several flying tiger bandits went outside and saw the poster, one of them asked what was written on it. The intrigued bandits requested that their village master read it for them. 
The poster was an advertisement for horses for sale, selling them below market value, at a discount of 20% if customers brought the flyer. Gao Fei Hu remained cool while reading the message, but he had the feeling that the terrible handwriting and weird sentences made his heart pump with excitement. A hand was yanking the poster from the tree, which perplexed Gao Fei Hu. He questioned Lao Er about what he was doing and why he was tearing it off. Lao Er smiled and gave Gao Fei Hu a thumbs up as he explained to him that if he brought this paper along, he would get a discount. Kin New Mountain's surroundings were filled with posters, and the dog head, wild boar, apricot blossom, bald head, and other bandits were mostly talking about it. Other bandits were reading the posters. More people were talking about it and decided to go and see what they were planning to do. Fast forward to Cheng Dale and some of his team standing outside Toad Village, where Zhu Shenji stated that he was skeptical that anyone would come, to which Cheng Dale replied that there was no need to rush. Cheng Dale confidently told him that the posters would take some time to attract people. Butler Wang thought to himself that he had just joined this arrogant person, that he always seemed to meet these kinds of people, and that he felt so unlucky, but he remained silent. Linger pointed them out and alerted their village master that they had arrived. A swarm of bandits on horseback was riding towards Toad Village. Cheng Dale ordered his team to move quickly, prepare their horses, and not make any mistakes. A horde of bandits stopped at the entrance to Toad Village, where Cheng Dale and Butler Wang stood, and a bandit demanded that they open the gate to their village because they were there to buy horses. Meanwhile, Kin Man was perched on the roof of its gate, preparing to draw an arrow, when Cheng Dale told him to hold his arrow, which he understood and agreed to. This irritated a sweaty Lao Er of the Flying Tiger Bandit who inquired if they really wanted to sell horses. Gao Feihu, the village master of the Flying Tiger Village, told them not to be mad, as they came there sincerely to buy horses. They brought the food and demanded that they should be allowed to see the horses first. Cheng Dale told everyone to calm down as he ordered Butler Wang to tell them the rules. Butler Wang announced that they would be using the hidden auction method. Gao Feihu, on horseback, inquired about the hidden auction method. Butler Wang said that because he had asked, he had also inquired if they could see the curtain. On the curtain was the silhouette of a horse, which was guarded. Butler Wang went on to explain that every time they held an auction, they would put a horse behind the curtain, and everyone would bid on it, with the highest bidder winning the horse. The bandits objected to this auction system since they would be unable to see the horse's condition, such as whether the horse was blind or handicapped, or if they swapped the auctioned horse for another. At this moment, Cheng Dale became irritated, urged them to stop talking, and threatened them with eating his thunder which scared the bandits. As a result, they remained silent and instructed Butler Wang to continue. Butler Wang reassured his fellow bandits that they did not do things like swapping the horse after they bid, and they could see movement behind the curtain, but they couldn't see what the horse looked like, and the horse they would get depended on their luck. He went on to say that they might only need a few sums to acquire an excellent horse, and because no one had any queries, he let the auction begin, with the first horse starting with a single bag of grain. The majority of the bandits remained silent and unwilling to take part. Zhu Shenji whispered to his village master what they should do because no one was bidding, to which Cheng Dale replied with concern that this could be a low-class horse. Suddenly, a lady yelled that she would be the first to bid. A group of armed lady bandits emerged, and one of them bid for one bag of beans. The male bandits were awestruck and praised her beauty. Zhu Shenji whispered to his village master and informed him that the lady bandit was from White Wolf from Apricot Blossom Village. As she was enraged, White Wolf drew her knife and yelled at them to stop looking, threatening them that she would dig out their eyeballs and feed them to the dogs. A bandit congratulated the Apricot Village master on purchasing the horse at a low cost while thinking in his mind that she acquired a good horse for only a bag of beans. Butler Wang stated that the Apricot Village had won the first horse and ordered Warrior Lin to take it out. A mighty and gorgeous white horse came out. The flying tiger bandit's jaws dropped as they recognized the white horse they had intended to steal previously. Meanwhile, several of the bandits were already planning to steal this horse from her. This infuriated the village master of Apricot Blossom Village, who threatened anyone who tried to steal her horse that she would kill them if they made any move. She then took the poster from her chest and asked if she might use this discount letter. Cheng Dali assured her that she had nothing to worry about, as he had kept his word and instructed Butler Wang to return her 20 kilograms of beans. While she was about to ride her horse, White Wolf stepped on the stirrup, thanked him, and she sat atop the horse, flipping her long blue hair. White Wolf smiled as she told her sisters to go back. As they were leaving, Zhu Shenji observed that she looked cuter while riding the horse, and Cheng Dale smiled at her. Cheng Dale blushed as he gazed in awe at her beauty. The crowd of bandits was noisy and impatient, with some pressing to hurry up and start the auction for the next horse, demanding that they not waste their time, while others had misplaced their flyer and asked their colleague to return it. Cheng Dale had the impression that the auction was finally going well. 
He then asked Zhu Shenji if he could tell him more about this white wolf, to which Zhu Shenji agreed because he knew a lot about her. Before she became a bandit, her family was a martial arts family. She had learned martial arts ever since she was a child and specialized in handling swords. But when she was about to marry, her husband died, and she was instead married to a coffin. Everyone thought she had jinxed her husband, so she was looked down on and ridiculed by people. Then one night, when her grandpa climbed onto her bed and wanted to take advantage of her, she stabbed him and ran towards Apricot Blossom Village. Back at Toad Village, Cheng Dale blushed when he asked Zhu Shenji if the Apricot Blossom Bandits were all girls, to which he answered that all Apricot Blossom Bandits had similar stories like White Wolf. Most of them were widows before or abandoned by their families. Cheng Dale sighed, wondering why Zhu Shenji hadn't told him such important information, and added that they should befriend the Apricot Blossom Bandits in the future. Zhu Shenji said that other kin New Mountain Bandits wanted to join hands with the Apricot Blossom Bandits, but they believed that all men are trash, so he advised him to give up that idea. Cheng Dale and Zhu Shenji's attention was drawn to a commotion, and a bandit grumbled that this was not what he wanted and accused them of doing it on purpose. This bandit went on to declare that this bid should not be counted because they deliberately sold him a blind horse. Butler Wang said that he had already attempted to stop him, but he had won the bid and they do not accept refunds. Cheng Dale approached them and inquired about the situation, to which Butler Wang replied that he had already attempted to stop the bandit but he kept raising the price for a blind horse. However, in Lauer's mind, he thought of them as greedy while Butler Wang kept stopping him. He felt it was a good horse and that they planned to hide it and sell it for a higher price, so he kept raising the price. This flying tiger bandit called Cheng Dale a cunning person. He grabbed Butler Wang and complained that he had given a lot of food bags, but they had given him a blind horse in return. Then, he demanded that the bid not count. Cheng Dale responded that they had already agreed that the rules cannot be changed. So, he calmly threatened to put a stop to the horse bidding. This enraged his fellow flying tiger bandits, as they did not want to stop the bidding, while others blamed the complaining bandit for being unlucky and displeased with his decision to retract his words. Gao Fei Hu of Flying Tiger Village ordered them to return the bags of food in order for them to head back. Lauer, the complaining bandit, accepted his fate and told him to take it, as his hand reached for his chest inside his clothes. He gave him his flyer and reminded him to give them a discount. Later on, Butler Wang announced to everyone to continue with the bidding. In the end, each horse was sold for at least 8 bags of food. A total of 76 horses were sold for 500 bags of food, a few pieces of equipment, weapons, and other items. One bag of grain means 100 kilograms, and 500 bags mean 50,000 kilograms of food. For them, it was a large amount. Toad Village had never had so much food before. Now, their storage vault was filled with wheat, soybeans, black beans, small grains, millet, and sorghum. Cheng Dale thought in his mind that, as expected, war was the easiest way to earn a profit. This amount was hard to earn from just farming. The sun was about to set when Cheng Dale suddenly remembered he still had a lottery draw chance left. Wang Xuan retreated, and he got a lottery draw reward chance. He would check his luck, as he would draw it tonight. A bandit was in command of his horse. It was the flying tiger bandits on their way back home. A bandit sighed as he struggled to control his horse. Gao Fei who questioned his comrades why they couldn't just walk while pulling the horse, to which Lao Er replied that they were a group of bandits with horses, and if they got off the horse, people would believe they were poor. They stopped temporarily to appreciate the rosy orange sunset, which inspired Lao Er to write a poem. However, his village master told him to shut up with his education, as he did not want to be tortured by his noisy poem. Lauer asked if there was really a lighting spell in this world, to which the village master believed that there was, as he had seen it with his own eyes. While he added that they should ask their advisor to come back, he must have known more about this. A few villagers were lurking in the bushes on the cliff edge of the mountain when a son asked his dad if there was a god in this world. His dad replied, questioning why wouldn't there be when Lai Dog had two horses that were given by the gods. After Lai Dog returned from the Toad Village with two horses, rumors spread around the village that those horses were given to him by the gods. His son was growing impatient as they waited for so long there but had yet to see any god, to which his dad replied that they should wait a little more because these things are about sincerity. Suddenly, they heard a distant noise, which alerted the dad, who assumed in his mind that they had finally arrived. The dad leaped off a cliff and told his sons to follow up and see his performance. A few moments later, Gao Fei who told Lao Er not to be mad as he liked to head back and eat some food with wine. While Lao Er responded if they would try to sell these two horses, he inquired if anyone would buy them. Gao Fei who disagreed and told him that he doesn't think that anyone is as stupid as him. The villager dad rolled off the mountain while his sons were worried about him. The dad chanted for the mountain god to spare him repeatedly, which surprised the flying tiger bandit. 
Gao Fei Hu and his bandits stopped while he asked them who they were. The dad and his sons kneeled and referred to them as the mountain god and said there are poor people living below the mountain. They have wheat but couldn't harvest it and asked for a few horses. The sweaty Lauer was enraged by the villagers' remarks. He got down from his horse and berated him, saying that he was scammed of so many bags of food yet here he was asking for a horse, not just one but a few, which confused the villager dad. He then grabbed the villager dad and wanted to throw punches. He rhetorically asked who sent him to piss him off. The villager dad was on the ground, pleading with the mountain god to spare him as they were poor people and they did not have anything while his sons were behind him, scared for their dad. However, Gao Fei who recognized him as the rich noble Lai Zhuang of Lai village, and they had passed through their territory before, but he had many guards, which is why he hadn't robbed them before. Now, he had come by himself. This amazed Lao Er, who responded that Lai Zhuang must have done some good deeds, and God took pity on them. He called it a blessing in disguise and ordered his comrade to tie them up and send someone to ask for ransom from their house. It was almost dark, and despite being partially obscured by clouds, the crescent moon was visible. Cheng Dali snapped his fingers and summoned the system goddess because it was time to draw the lottery. The system goddess excitedly exclaimed, Here we go. Cheng Dali told the system goddess that he didn't ask for much. Just a bazooka, rocket launcher, tank, or helicopter would do, while the system goddess shook the lottery machine. However, it got stuck. The system goddess shook the lottery machine hard while Cheng Dali stood behind and remained silent. She got upset and said that she had only ignored the bug once, and now the lottery machine was teasing her. In her outrage, she kicked the lottery machine, and a draw ball came out of it. She was relieved that it finally came out, but it hit Cheng Dale on his head before falling to the ground. The draw ball opened, and Cheng Dale obtained the beginner defense drawing for the bandit. He thought to himself that this time the reward was completely different. That construction map was amazing. Last time, they had only five people, and no one wanted to mess with them. Now, things were different. They already had 50,000 kilograms of food and were richer, and everyone would be eager to rob them. But he was only a small bandit. If they encountered a disaster, he wondered what would happen to them. Time was running out. In the morning, on the cliff side of Stone Mountain, Cheng Dale asked Butler Wang, as he was more knowledgeable and well-informed, where he thought they could recruit people from. Cheng Dale wanted to expand their manpower. Butler Wang replied that it might be hard. Cheng Dale asked why it would be difficult, and Butler Wang explained that the people of the empire could be divided into four classes. This piqued Cheng Dale's interest, and he asked Butler Wang to explain the classes in detail. Obviously, the first class is the empire's royal family. The Laishi family was established 120 years ago. They have a lot of honor and authority, and they do not have to work. They are worshipped by many. The second class is the aristocracy, which includes noble families, city lords, and rich merchants. The third class consists of the common people, including landlords, squires, and small merchants. Lastly, the fourth class comprises outcasts, villagers, wanderers, slaves, and such. Cheng Dali asked which class bandits belong to. Butler Wang explained that bandits do not have a class, which means they could be ranked in the lowest class. The empire does not recognize bandits as their people. They are considered even worse than wanderers, slaves, and beggars. Most bandits are normal people who had no other ways to survive. Some would seek death instead of becoming a bandit. If a family had a bandit, it is considered a disgrace to their ancestors. Cheng Dale was surprised to learn that the existence of bandits was worse than trash. He then told Butler Wang that he had prepared a plan to build a wall around the village to reinforce the original defense facilities. Butler Wang responded that it sounded good but they lacked manpower. With a scroll of paper in his hand, Cheng Dale responded that he would find a way to solve it. He then handed the scroll of paper to Butler Wang, explaining that this was the defense system he designed. When Butler Wang opened it, he was amazed by his village master and asked if he had made this. Despite the fact that the system gave it to him, Cheng Dale believed it counted as something he made up, which he confirmed to Butler Wang. Butler Wang knelt and thanked his village master for his skill, promising to do his best to support him. Cheng Dale continued to say that regarding the matter of manpower, he would think of a way. If they couldn't find any, they could just recruit people from other bandit groups. Butler Wang replied to his village master that this could be a problem because they might act as spies to gather information about them. Cheng Dale replied that if that method didn't work, they would still have some dynamite left. Cheng Dale ordered him to go back and prepare things with the military strategists. He needed to take a look at the village landscape. At the brink of the cliffside, Cheng Dale thought to himself that this cliff was quite high. He stayed there until the skies turned rosy orange, with the sun about to set. 
Cheng Dalei thought to himself that from here, he could clearly see the coordinates and layout of the Toad Village, which was in a complete mess. He thought the previous bandit leader didn't plan anything properly. He just randomly constructed the village, and he might have to destroy and rebuild it. The system goddess emerged and alerted that the exploration of the Toad Village was completed. As a reward, the Toad Village landscape was imprinted into his brain. Cheng Dalei closed his eyes and thought to himself that this meant that next time, all he needed to do was explore any place, and he could get a map out of it. He then opened his eyes and thought that was very useful information. Gao Fei who was roasting meat as he sat by the bonfire at the Flying Tiger Bandit's village. Suddenly, he was surprised as he heard several knocks and heard the proclamation of great news, repeatedly. Gao Fei who thought to himself upon hearing that sound again that he had a bad feeling about it. However, Lauer grinned in excitement as he urged him to go outside. A lot of posters were plastered on the tree trunk again, and his fellow bandits asked their village master to quickly read what was written on the flyer this time. Lauer volunteered to read it for them. It was another advertisement from the Toad Village, recruiting people and enticing them with noodles and pancakes. This flyer made Gao Fei Hu visibly upset, while Lauer was pleased while reading. The idea of riding the coolest horse and enjoying beautiful girls sounded amazing. Gao Fei Hu became enraged and called Cheng Dalei a bastard, saying he had never seen such a shameless person. Gao Fei Hu went on to say that he was so shameless that he was trying to recruit people from other villages, and he couldn't stand it any longer. He ordered his comrade to bring his sword, and he was going to question him while Lao Er was salivating for noodles and a pancake. Lao Er told him to calm down. They sat near the bonfire when Gao Fei Hu asked how he could calm down when they were trying to bully them, to which Lao Er replied that they needed to wait a little bit longer for their military advisor to come back. He offered him a bottle and told him to drink some wine to cool down. Gao Fei Hu drank the wine right away. While the bandits of the Flying Tiger were talking about going to Toad Village to test their luck, as they were drooling over noodles and pancakes, and wondered if they would have weapons if they went. Lauer told Gao Fei Hu that he had an idea and asked if he wanted to hear it. He went on to say that since they wanted to recruit people from their village, they could send their brothers over to eat their food and drinks. Lauer clenched his fist when he said that they would find the right opportunity to strike and occupy Toad Village. Gao Fei Hu was stunned by his comrade's remarks, while Lauer inquired if he liked his plan. However, Gao Fei Hu responded no, he was surprised as he did not expect that he would know about the word opportunity, which left Lao Er dumbfounded. A man was narrating his experience at Toad Village. His name was Zhu Zio Shu, a minion of Flying Tiger Village, and his parents were bandits, so he was born as a bandit. Actually, his life as a bandit was not that great. People assumed that bandits ate meat and drank wine all the time. But it had been more than a year since Xu Zio Shu last ate a meal. These two years had been terrible, with no harvest and barren farms. When there was no grain to eat, poor people were forced to search for wild vegetables around the mountains. Today, he went to Toad Village with the second master of Flying Tiger Village, thinking they would join them. Lauer, the second master, said this was a scheme, but he didn't know any further details, so he would just tag along. Many bandits from other villages also came, but Butler Wang was blocking everyone from entering. He was saying that they needed to register first. Everyone else was standing in a queue, but the second master wanted to cut the queue and was blocked. He thought the second master was quite stupid. Since he was illiterate, he couldn't understand what was written on the paper. He was only attempting to replicate what the person in front of him did, but he was ashamed since he couldn't draw a circle properly. So, someone handed him a saw and told him to work by himself. The second master had no objections either. He was given the task to cut wood while the second master was assigned to move the timber. At noon, a pretty girl came by and told them that if they worked hard, they would get to eat dumplings in the afternoon. Dumplings were luxury foods they only eat during the new year. He still remembered that last year, after he ate a single bowl of dumplings, he couldn't bring himself to eat wild vegetables or bread for a few days. At lunch, they had dumplings. The dumplings had white shiny skin, and there was meat and wild vegetables inside. He ate three bowls, and he never imagined that one day he could eat dumplings until he was full, while he could still remember being scolded last year just for eating an extra dumpling during the new year. That night, Toad Village gave them five kilograms of food. After returning to their village, they told everyone about today's event. Everyone was suspicious at first and didn't believe what they said. He even heard someone say that the village master was so selfish when the second master requested that the village master send all of them to Toad Village. Now that they had made a fuss, he might not be able to go to Toad Village tomorrow. He pondered if such a good thing could happen to him every day. So just in case they did not allow him to go, he would sneak out by himself. One day's work at Toad Village was worth 5 kilograms of food. If he worked for a few more days, he would not have to worry about food during the winter. His parents had not eaten noodles and buns for more than a year. This year was bad because it hadn't rained in a long time. 
but he shouldn't think too much because he needed sleep first. A few moments later, inside Flying Tiger Village, the second master told Gao Fei Hu that the food they cooked was very delicious and that they also used just the right amount of salt. He laughed when he told him that he had secretly stolen some of their salt and they would never discover what he did. Gao Fei Hu was eating when the second master told him that he had sent him there to find out about Cheng Dali's thunder spell, and inquired whether he had found anything yet. The second master said that Cheng Dali had not even shown up today. Gao Fei Hu told him that when he went there the next day, he should bring more people with him so that they could find out all about his tricks. The second master enthusiastically agreed, saying he would go there tomorrow since he really wanted to eat more of their food, and begged him to come along because each meal had noodles. Gao Fei Hu cursed him to fuck off. The next day, at least a thousand more guests arrived. Butler Wang, as expected, had excellent management skills. Some people were tasked with using stones to build walls, digging up earth, and smithing bricks. The whole village was filled with energetic people. Miss Su, on the other hand, was deafeningly quiet. She was sitting next to Cheng Dale and inquired why he wasn't going outside, to which he replied that he wanted his presence to be more mysterious. The rumors spread that Cheng Dale was increasing his cultivation and learning thunder spells. If he went outside too much and people saw that he, too, needed to use the toilet like them, all of their admiration for him would collapse. She then asked him why he was staying in her room. He replied because she was pretty. Miss Su stayed silent. Cheng Dale continued to torment her, telling her that he thought she was the most beautiful woman on the mountain, and Miss Su called him a liar. The bandits continued to work with the logs and stones. When someone pointed out that Kin Man was lifting a 340 kilograms weight, and was impressed by his strength, Kin Man, who was sweating profusely, modestly replied that he was not that amazing. Others asked Kin Man to demonstrate his strength just once. Suddenly, Kin Man lifted a stone mill while he said that he would try it out. This shocked the bandits because the stone mill weighed at least 450 kilograms, and they warned him not to overwork himself. Kin Man held up the stone mill with both of his hands, amazing several bandits with his monstrous strength, while others speculated that his strength must be more than 500 kilograms. Then Kin Man put down the stone mill. He humbly replied that he was nothing because he was not the strongest person there, and that his village master had twice his strength. Cheng Dale was watching them through a window and decided it was time for him to make his appearance. Miss Su stood by and watched him leave. She then peeked out of her window when the bandits recognized Cheng Dale and requested that he demonstrate his strength. Kin Man requested that his village master spar with him, but Cheng Dale told him that he did not have time for that and advised him to return to work. Kin Man, apparently unhappy, questioned his village master if he was looking down on him. He charged straight at Cheng Dale, who stayed calm. His fists were ready to strike, but Cheng Dale blocked him with his hand. Kin Man's hand trembled from the block, and he struggled to hold it. Cheng Dale instructed him to get lost as he let go of his hand, and Kin Man flew through the woods. He approached Kin Man, who was lying on the ground, and inquired if he was well, to which he replied that he was fine and thanked him for being gentle with him. Cheng Dale offered his assistance and warned him not to be impulsive the next time since he would get hurt if he used more than 60% of his strength. The bandits' jaws dropped in surprise, they wondered how strong he would be if he used 100%. Butler Wang ordered everyone to start working and those of them who were stronger to come over while he pointed his hand in a direction. He told them that they needed to smash a massive rock and dig out its materials to build walls. The bandits were talking about the boulder weighing more than 1,000 kilograms, speculating who could smash it and suggesting that Butler Wang should try it himself. Another bandit suggested the Toad Village Master do it since he has monstrous strength and could easily break it. Butler Wang inquired of his village master if he would be bothered to smash a boulder, to which Cheng Dale replied that he should not come and ask him to do such small tasks. He also gestured for them to back up while stretching both of his hands. Cheng Dale gestured with his hand to call lightning. An explosive burst occurred on the ground, resulting in a loud noise and debris flying everywhere. The bandits were startled and used their hands to block the debris. Cheng Dali continued to gesture with his hands and told them once again not to bother him with small matters like this. He looked at them and questioned rhetorically what they were waiting for before telling them to get to work. The bandits instantly began working and stated that they were on it. Cheng Dali walked away while Butler Wang wished him a nice day. A few moments later, inside a house, Miss Su asked him what had happened to him, to which he complained that his back hurts. Ten days later, the construction project was completed, and the entire Toad Village was given a new look. It has now been divided into several areas. The outermost area is the defensive zone, surrounded by stones and mountains. There is also a watchtower near the wall. As long as the enemies are in clear sight, the person on the watchtower can spot them and quickly alert the whole village. Behind the defensive area is the preparation zone. If the invaders somehow break through the outer walls, this area will be used to slow them down. 
It includes a working area, a horse stable, a blacksmith smithy, a hospital, and many other necessary facilities. A public toilet has also been built near the horse stable, as artificial fertilizers are also important. Next is the residential area, consisting of living quarters, houses, kitchens, a water well, a weapons depot, and a granary. All the trees outside have been chopped down, and there are traps set on the seemingly flat ground, designed by Kin Man. These traps include horse pits, lassos, and a specific trap for catching wild boars. Butler Wang reported to Cheng Dale that they had given away almost all of their food. They were left with 100 kilograms of food, but they don't have to worry because their village doesn't have that many people. Cheng Dale instructed Butler Wang to go back and arrange food expenses and accommodations for other people because they were going to start storing food and preparing to recruit more people. Butler Wang smiled and agreed. Someone informed Cheng Dale with a laugh that the construction of the village had been completed and the system was rewarding him with one acre of chili plants and the evolution of systematic animals. Cheng Dale complained that one acre of chili was a bit too little. The system goddess appeared taller and bigger. Cheng Dale told her that she looked different. She laughed as she explained that every time there was a big change in the village, she would also upgrade herself. Then she raised her hand and told him to move forward bravely and become the bandit king. A pop-up box appeared with a list of missions to be achieved. The first mission was to change Miss Sue's impression of him using a non-violent approach for an unknown prize. The second was to recruit 100 people for Toad Village for an unknown reward. And the third was to complete 10 robberies for an unknown reward. Meanwhile, Gao Fei Hu of the Flying Tiger Bandits sat at a wooden table with a cup in his hand, being told that if he were present at the scene, he would be stunned. The second master went on to add that when Cheng Dale used some thunder technique, he roared, and a massive boulder exploded, they were all terrified. Gao Fei Hu inquired of his advisor, who stood next to the second master, about his thoughts on this. He explained that he picked this rock from the canyon where the explosion occurred, and the mark was caused by dynamite. He further explained that there was no such thing as a thunder technique and that he got tricked. The system goddess emerged with a pop-out box of information for Yu Q Ran, a good military advisor at the age of 42, whose skills are knowledgeable and experienced traveler. Gao Fei who was confused about dynamite. He then further explained that it was similar to firecrackers, but its power was more devastating, and dynamite is rare even in the outside world, so there was no way the people of Kin New Mountain knew about it. Gao Fei who clarified that he meant they had been fooled by the Toad Village, to which he replied in affirmation. In addition, the second master inquired whether there were any thunder techniques, to which he replied that there were none. This infuriated Gao Fei who since they had been fooled and had rashly declared an invasion of the Toad Village. However, military advisor Yu Q Ran recommended that there was no need to rush, and that the Toad Village could be dealt with later, to which Gao Fei who responded that he wanted to vent his anger on them. He then replied that sooner or later he would get his chance, but they had something important to do right now, and the Toad Village could wait. Fast forward, Cheng Dale was thinking in his mind that he had three missions, that recruiting would be difficult, and that the third assignment could be completed by Kin Man and Warrior Lin. Then he was only left with one mission, changing Miss Su Ying's impression of him using nonviolent methods. This was stage two of robbing a girl to become a bandit's woman, and if he fulfilled these types of connected missions, he would receive a large reward. Cheng Dali came to the conclusion that if he wanted to win her heart, he needed to be a smooth talker. He laughed and ran, expressing that he had not joined so many dating sites for nothing, and now it was time to put his knowledge to good use. This confused the system goddess. A few moments later, he called for Miss Su. She looked back at him when Cheng Dali nonchalantly added, I love you to her. Miss Su walked away, leaving him stunned. Cheng Dale thought her response was supposed to be different because, in his mind, Miss Su would blush when he told her, I like you. However, determined Cheng Dale decided to proceed with Plan B since Plan A had failed. So, he would follow her around and discreetly tell her things like where he had seen this beautiful woman before, but Miss Su would ignore him. Cheng Dale would refer to her as his sweetheart and ask her where she was going, but she would ignore him. Cheng Dale proceeded nonchalantly, telling her that he just wanted one thing from the world, to love her and think about her every day. Miss Su had nothing to reply. Cheng Dale even left some notes in Miss Su's room. She would open these notes with love-related words, many of which made no sense. Miss Su was becoming irritated by the few notes she opened, but she remained silent. Cheng Dale continued to bombard her with lines about love, such as love is passionate and love is blind. He told her that there was no better promise he could make, that he would be the best she could ever find. Miss Su was frequently startled by these statements. Cheng Dale persisted in telling her to keep him in her heart rather than her head because the mind forgets, but the heart always remembers that he loves her. He referred to himself as her honey. Finally, Miss Su handed Cheng Dale his checks, which surprised him. Miss Su inquired whether he was sick. Cheng Dale was left speechless with disappointment. 
Cheng Dali looks depressed when suddenly Shenji calls him. Shenji informs Cheng Dali that Ling'er has been poisoned, to which Cheng Dali reacts with shock and asks to be taken to see her immediately. When they arrive, Cheng Dali sees Xiao Ling lying in pain, and he calls out to her. Xiao Ling responds weakly, saying she might die soon. Cheng Dali asks what happened and why she was poisoned. Shenji explains that Xiao Ling was picking mushrooms at the back of the mountain and ate a red fruit, which caused her mouth to swell, burn, and sweat profusely. Shenji laments his daughter's love of eating things and promises to find a way to cure her. Cheng Dali asks what kind of poisonous fruit Xiao Ling ate, and Shenji shows him the fruit, to which Cheng Dali is surprised that it was a chili. Shenji asked if Cheng Dali knows about the poisonous fruit. He then explains that chili is a vegetable and a spice, not a poisonous fruit. Cheng Dali then tells him that it was a bit spicy for Ling Er, and that she was shocked as she ate it the first time but will be fine once she drinks water. Cheng Dali remembers that chili has been known since the Kang Dynasty and wonders how they didn't recognize it. He wants to confirm it and asks Su Ying about it. In the subsequent scene, Cheng Dali turns and shows the chili to Su Ying and asks her about it. Su Ying questionably replies that it's some kind of fruit. Cheng Dali then asks Su Ying about the taste and wonders if he could potentially make a lot of money by selling it. Su Ying, not having tried it before, expresses curiosity. Cheng Dali proposes that she tastes it, considering her opinion. Meanwhile, Cheng Dali reflects on the fact that even Su Ying doesn't recognize the chili, indicating that it doesn't exist in this era. He recalls that chili took time to become known worldwide, and he obtained it early thanks to a system's reward considering it a luxurious object with a strong association with wealth. As Su Ying tastes the chili and finds it spicy, Cheng Dali shifts the conversation, remarking that it has been many days since Su Ying was kidnapped and wondering if nobody is coming to redeem her because she's not wanted. Su Ying's reaction shows irritation and surprise at Cheng Dali's comment. Cheng Dali assures Su Ying that even if the whole world were to betray her, he would not, declaring that he would betray the whole world just to be with her. Cheng Dali then smiles widely. Soon after, Xiao Yu arrives and announces that he has finished hunting. Cheng Dali inquires if Xiao Yu caught anything worthwhile, and Xiao Yu replies that he only caught a rabbit and a girl who claims to be a maid from the Su family. A child interjects, accusing Cheng Dali of eating their miss. Cheng Dali expresses surprise that such a young girl would come to King Niu Mountain. Su Ying recognizes the girl as Xiao Yi and calls out to her. Xiao Yi expresses relief that Su Ying is still alive and mentions that she was worried she might have been eaten by them. Su Ying reassures Xiao Yi that she has done well, then Xiao Yi asks if Cheng Dali humiliated her, to which Su Ying confirms that she's fine. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale senses that the Su family may be facing some problems, so he decides to call San Yuan and Xiao Yu to understand the situation better. As Xiao Yu goes out hunting, he initially plans to rob someone, but he is surprised when only a small girl approaches him. She introduces herself as Xiao Yi, Su Ying's maid, and reveals that she specifically came to King New Mountain to find Su Ying. Despite the potential danger, Xiao Yi shows no fear and is determined to locate Su Ying at all costs. Initially, Xiao Yu intends to send Xiao Yi back to Fallen Leaf City, but when she learns that Xiao Yu is from Toad Village, she insists on accompanying him and coming along with him. Upon hearing the story, both Cheng Dale and Sen Yuan express disbelief. They ponder why she didn't scream for help if she encountered other bandits and speculate if it's because Xiao Yu is handsome, jokingly considering his attractiveness as a reason for her trust. Cheng Dali shifts the conversation and asks San Yuan how much ransom they should ask from the Su family. San Yuan hesitates, explaining that the situation within the Su family is chaotic. Cheng Dali questions him about it, and San Yuan reveals that the boss of the four sea merchants, Su Si Hai, has no sons but multiple daughters, and Su Ying is the most talented and suitable for inheriting the business. However, the problem lies in the fact that Su Ying's mother passed away, and now the stepmother has control over the business. The stepmother desires her own daughter to inherit the business and harbors a strong dislike for Su Ying. San Yuan thinks that they might have hoped for Su Ying to be dead at the hands of Cheng Dale. Suddenly, Su Ying interrupts, expressing her intention to leave and find a way to gather the ransom. Cheng Dale questions her decision, but Su Ying remains silent. Cheng Dale realizes that San Yuan had previously mentioned that people with even a little bit of fortune would not choose to become bandits. What's more, Su Ying is the daughter of the rich merchant. On the next day, Cheng Dale sits down and writes a letter. He speaks aloud as he writes about the ransom for Su Ying's life because he can consume humans. On that occasion, Su Ying reads the letter, which requests 500 grains, clothes, rice paper, salt, wine, and books. She then sighs and comments that he was not asking for much and promises to send him double the requested items once she solves her problems at home. After that moment, Cheng Dale informs Su Ying that Xiao Yu and San Yuan will accompany them safely to the Fallen Leaf City since the city is about 70 to 80 miles away. 
Cheng Dale then gives Su Ying some chili and suggests that she use it to earn profits since he heard that her family owns a restaurant, which Su Ying agrees to. At that time, Cheng Dale thinks that he has tried his best to impress her but has failed to touch her heart, wondering if her heart is made of stone. He then instructs them to prepare as it is getting late. Cheng Dale crosses paths with Su Ying and recites a poetic saying, Flowers bloom on the street but return slowly. Su Ying then stops Cheng Dale and decides to have a conversation with him, to which Cheng Dale asks if there's something she wants to talk about. She expresses her thoughts, saying that Cheng Dale had said many nice things and did things to make her happy, leading her to believe that she might fall in love with him. However, she suspects that everything he said and did was fake. Cheng Dale looks guilty as he doesn't respond. Su Ying continued, stating that he cannot expect to receive genuine love when he only offered fake feelings. She emphasized that whether he is sincere to her or not is not important, and the same goes for her sincerity toward him. Cheng Dale asked her if there's anything she wanted. She replied that before they bid farewell, she simply wanted him to be honest and tell her a genuine feeling. Cheng Dale pondered what a real feeling would be, considering the feelings he had when he first saw her. He then leaned in and whispered something in her ear. Cheng Dale said to Su Ying that when he first saw her, he got hard and started to trail off. Su Ying, not understanding what he meant, asks him to clarify. Cheng Dale is shocked and embarrassed by what he said and is unsure how to respond. Su Ying sees Cheng Dale blushing and asks again what he meant. He stays silent, making her sulky and doesn't care anymore and tells him that she will ask someone else about it. Cheng Dale gets frantic and asks her not to tell anyone but eventually tells Su Ying that he will tell her once they meet again. Later, in that moment, Cheng Dale thinks that Su Ying is only 17 years old and likely has a mindset that kissing could lead to pregnancy. He considers her young and innocent, lacking knowledge about such matters. He realizes that he has said and done many things that may seem foolish or laughable. He wonders if Su Ying's heart is like an abyss. He even questions if he has been deceiving himself. Amidst his thoughts, the system alerts the completion of the second stage of robbing a wife with a reward of a heavy crossbow. However, other notes indicate that the conditions were unmet, preventing the triggering of phase 3 of the mission. As the sun sets inside the carriage, Xiao Yi expresses her shock, mentioning that she didn't expect Cheng Dale to let them go. She then senses that something is bothering Su Ying, so Xiao Yi asks if she has something on her mind. Su Ying asks Xiao Yi what it means when a man says he is hard, but Xiao Yi is skeptical about the word in question. Upon arriving in Fallen Leaf City at night, Su Ying questions whether Cheng Dale's heart is hardened. After bidding farewell to Su Ying, Cheng Dale gathered himself and found the heavy crossbow from the reward, which he planned to use for defense. Kin Man asked where the crossbow came from, prompting Cheng Dale to suggest placing it on the watchtower. Afterwards, Cheng Dale decided to nurture and grow chili. He remembered his past experience in cultivating plants and believed it shouldn't be too challenging. He thought about the process of drying the chili and extracting the seeds. He also planned to fertilize the soil, dig small holes, plant the seeds, and cover them with soil. During that moment, Shenji interrupted the thought process and suggested going down the mountain to rob someone. But Cheng Dale dismissed the idea and accused Shenji of not wanting to help with the chili cultivation. Meanwhile, below King Mew Mountain, when White Wolf approached Cheng Dale, questioning why he had come down to rob someone in the hot weather, Cheng Dale replied and claimed to be a professional bandit. He then asked why she had to come to this location in the hot weather, implying that she was looking for him. In response, White Wolf mentioned receiving information about a promising opportunity, and wondered if Cheng Dale would be interested in cooperating with them. Cheng Dale suggested discussing the matter back in the village. White Wolf noticed the chili plants and mistook them for fruits. Cheng Dale clarified that they were chilies and offered some to White Wolf for cultivation, but White Wolf didn't reply to it. Later, Cheng Dale offered her a cup while apologizing, as he could only serve her well water. He then asked about the upcoming opportunity she was talking about. White Wolf revealed that a batch of birthday gifts would be transported through King New Mountain in a month. She then proposed that Cheng Dale and her group team up to rob those gifts. Cheng Dale questioned if the gifts were from Zhu Ban Chuen, to which White Wolf confirmed, a sly smile crossing her lips. White Wolf explained that Zhu Ban Chuen, who had occupied the city, needed to pacify the local forces and secure support from the city lord of Yuzhu to stabilize his position. White Wolf suggested that the number of gifts would be large, and they would use the specified route. She proposed an alliance, highlighting their combined strength and the potential to become rich. Cheng Dale hesitates, stating that he cannot kill innocent people due to his godly spell, fearing punishment from the heavens. White Wolf expresses disappointment in Cheng Dale's indecisiveness and withdraws the offer of cooperation. Cheng Dale contemplates wanting to participate but not wanting to risk any losses. Before White Wolf departs, Cheng Dale offers her some chili plants 
suggesting she grows them. Once the chilies are fully grown, she can exchange them with the village for food. White Wolf insists that Cheng Dali keeps the chilies for himself. Later that night, a bandit from the Zhu family approached Toad Village looking for Cheng Dali, requesting to borrow some seeds for farming and promising to return them twice the number of what they borrowed. Cheng Dali thinks that the Zhu bandit family has a small number of members, mostly elderly and children, and they lack both manpower for farming and seeds. Cheng Dali asks him if they cultivate chili, to which the man questions about it. Cheng Dali suggests that they cultivate chili and offers them some seeds to take back and grow. He then explains that chili is a valuable product and can be exchanged for other food items such as wheat, grain, soybeans, and chestnuts. He directs the bandit to San Yuan to obtain the chili seeds. Cheng Dali thinks, expressing his concern that even the mountain bandits, who don't pay taxes, face a shortage of food, indicating a potential famine. After a few days, Xiao Yu and San Yuan return from Fallen Leaf City, bringing back pigs, chickens, cloth, salt, paper, grain, and a pen. Meanwhile, 50 to 60 bandits are scouting the area around 50 kilometers away from King New Mountain, preparing to ambush the guards. The news of the gifts spreads quickly throughout the mountain, and everyone becomes eager to snatch them. While Cheng Dale focuses on raising chickens, growing vegetables, and occasionally robbing people. Cheng Dale, Xiao Yu, and Kin Man take turns being on duty, and after 10 days, they have completed almost half of their tasks. Even when they encounter small merchants, they only take insignificant items like buttons in return. Sometimes they even show them the way out of Kin New Mountain, he really can't lay his hands on innocent people. Xiao Yu expresses his perspective that their actions may not truly be considered as robbery. Cheng Dale responds that he can't rob the man because he's poor. However, he states that someday they will find a fat sheep to rob. In another place on Kin New Mountain, a woman asks the man to slow down and wait for her. She states that they should go back to Yuzhu City. The man responds by stating that traveling provides real-life experiences that cannot be found in books. He mentions that if he had stayed in Zhu City, he wouldn't have witnessed the beautiful scenes he is currently encountering. The woman questions what kind of nice scenes could be found in this seemingly poor place and expresses concern about the dangers of the area, including the presence of mountain bandits. The man brushes off the concern, saying he would cut down any bandits. Suddenly, Cheng Dale bursts out from the nearby bushes, blocking their path, causing the woman and the man to be startled. The man shouts bandit in alarm, and Cheng Dale calls them to stand in the middle. He thought that the woman is a eunuch. The man takes action and reassures the woman not to be afraid declaring that he is there with her. However, the man contemplates how he will compete with his sword against a big axe. He remains silent for a moment before stating that they surrender. The woman is taken aback by the man's decision to surrender and expresses her surprise, as well as Cheng Dali's confused face. At that time, the man introduces the woman as his sister and attempts to negotiate, offering to leave her behind if it satisfies Cheng Dali, and allows him to leave. The woman becomes flustered and exclaims, how could my brother sell me? The man attempts to justify his actions, assures the woman that he has a bright future ahead, and promises to always remember her sacrifice. The woman is upset, she scolds him, calling him a bastard, and expressing her disbelief that he would consider selling her. Cheng interrupts their argument, asking for their names. The woman reveals her name as Lai Wan'er, and the man is Lai Zing Zai. He also asks about their professions. Xing Zai responds hesitantly, stating that he is a scholar. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale expresses disappointment, considering scholars to be poor people. Cheng Dale then asks why the scholar is there, to which Xing Zai confirms that his dream is to travel the world and write many poems. He realizes that Xing Zai aspires to explore various places. He sarcastically remarks on their current situation, revealing that they have been kidnapped, showing that Xing Zai and Wan Er maintain a poker face. Later, back at the Toad Village, Wan Er recognizes their location as the rumored Toad Village and asks Cheng Dale if it is true. Curious, Cheng Dale questions her statement, wondering what led her to believe it was the Toad Village. Xing Zai explains that they were the ones who, with just five men, fended off an army of 1,000, causing the soldiers from Black Rock City to flee in fear, even abandoning their armor and weapons. Cheng Dale is taken aback and wonders if he has become famous. Wanner has heard rumors about their group that eats humans and drinks their blood. She asks him if they kidnapped them to be their food. Cheng Dale finds the rumor ridiculous and points to himself, asking them if his face looks like that of a cannibal, to which Wanner agrees. He then shifts the conversation, setting the rules straight, and informs them that as long as they stay peaceful, he won't harm or imprison them. However, he warns them that King New Mountain is filled with bandits, and if they believe they can leave this place alive, then they should be his guests. Wanner questions why they are being kept there. Her face turns red as she foretells something without finishing her sentence. Cheng Dale then explains that since they are scholars with knowledge, they are to write down everything they know. 
Once they finish writing, he promises to escort them out of King New Mountain safely. He instructs Shenji to prepare ink and arrange a separate room for the captives. Later, in the captives' room, Wan'er is curious about Xing Zai's decision to surrender and mentions how even their sword mastery teacher praised his skills. Xing Zai responds to the question with another question to Wan'er. Xing Zai tells her that he finds the bandit village interesting. Wan'er is confused about how that place could be interesting. Xing Zai explains that the bandits kidnapping people for knowledge is intriguing. He finds it amazing. Pointing towards his sister, he instructs her to prepare the ink while declaring that as a poet, he will write a poem. Somewhere in Toad Village, Cheng Dalei asks about the news, and Sen Yuan informs him that the escorting team will reach King New Mountain within the next 10 days. Based on the information they gathered, they will be sending a person named Lu Heng to escort the gift. Cheng Dalei expresses curiosity about Lu Heng and asks for more details about him. Lu Heng is around 30 years old, he is an orphan and uses a big stick as his main weapon, adopted and taken care of since he has no parents or relatives. San Yuan adds that Lu Heng is loyal and quite strong. Cheng Dalei points out the obvious that if Lu Heng is strong, the other bandits wouldn't plan to rob him. San Yuan agrees and suggests that they might resort to ambush, poison, or traps instead of engaging in direct confrontation. He then asks Cheng Dalei if they should interfere. Cheng Dalei contemplates the situation and mentions that they only have a few people. The scene then shifts to King New Mountain, where an atmosphere of restlessness can be felt throughout. Inside the Toad Village, Xing Zai banged on the door of Wan Er's room, calling her name excitedly. He told her that he had something to show her and urged her to get up. Wan Er, slightly annoyed by his behavior, asked him if he had stolen the servant girl's clothes again, implying that he had a habit of doing such things. Xing Zai denied it and asked her to stop talking about the past. He then insisted that they go out so he could show her something. While they were walking and talking in the Toad Village, Wan Er was curious and questioned Xing Zai about the outdoor bathing. Xing Zai clarified that it was not about bathing, but rather about what was in the pool. He explained that the spring water came down from the mountain into a basin covered with straw to keep out insects and dust. The basin also contained gravel and charcoal. Wanner was slightly confused and asked about the purpose of using charcoal in the water, to which Xing Zai confirmed that charcoal could indeed be used to purify the water from vermin. Wanner asked about the possibility of bugs in the water, and Xing Zai admitted that he didn't fully understand the details but had taken the trouble to create such a pool because it was useful. A minute later, somewhere in the Toad Village, Wanner questioned why Xing Zai was leading her to the hut, asking if it didn't stink. Xing Zai urged her to go inside and have a look, but Wanner refused, saying she didn't want to. Xing Zai didn't persuade her and stated that if she didn't go in, he would tell her about it. Xing Zai proceeded to explain that there was a large hole beneath the hut that connected to the stable for horses and pigs. He mentioned that there were beetles that could fly into humans' bodies and make them sick. He also mentioned the potential to dig out fertile fields. Wanner questioned the purpose of it all, and Xing Zai admitted that he wasn't entirely sure but believed they were useful. He mentioned that the more you explored the world, the more you would learn, and then asked Wanner if she thought the village was simple. Wanner responded by pointing out that there were only six people in total, implying that their resources and capabilities might be limited. Xing Zai agrees but counters by mentioning the owner of the mountain stronghold and hinting at their big plants. Wanner then asks Xing Zai to stop staring at the thatched cottage in a suggestive manner and accuses him of being a pervert. She starts to say something more, but Xing Zai shushes her, urging her not to say it. After that moment, in the evening, Cheng Dalei visits Xing Zai and asks him how things are going. Xing Zai replies that he has been writing everything he saw and heard in Jingzhu. Xing Zai asks him why he was asking about the writings, to which Cheng Dalei simply responds with writing books. Xing Zai questionably asks about it, and Cheng Dalei responds, acknowledging Xing Zai as a poet while emphasizing his own aspiration to write a masterpiece that will be passed down through generations. He comments that if he doesn't look like a writer, both Xing Zai and Wanner express neutrality at the remark. Cheng Dalei shifts the topic, asking about Xing Zai's poetry to see the poems he has written. Xing Zai proudly mentions that he has written a few songs that even the established masters are impressed by. Cheng Dalei gets intrigued and snatches the paper from Xing Zai's hands, proceeding to read the poems. After reading them, Cheng Dalei expresses a condescending opinion, suggesting that they can barely be called poetry and expressing his concern about the poetic talent in the empire. Wan Er, wanting to defend Xing Zai, interjects, stating that Xing Zai's poems are famous throughout Jingzhu. Cheng Dalei suggests that they open their eyes and see what real poetry is. He then writes something and makes a comment, saying that if his writing spreads around in public, he'll be afraid that the talents in the entire empire would be too afraid to pick up a pen. Xing Zai smiles and responds with a sarcastic remark about Cheng Dalei's confident tone, while Wan Er thinks that Cheng Dalei is too boastful. After Cheng Dalei finishes writing, he abruptly declares that it's getting late and advises them to rest. 
He then walks to the door but stops by Zing Zai, questioning why he's only writing one sentence. Chang Dalei explains that one sentence is enough, jokingly claiming that he might scare them to death if he wrote the whole poem. Zing Zai adds that he doesn't know about the talents in the world. But after reading the sentence, he wouldn't be able to write anything in his life again. The following day, in the morning, Shen Ji informs Cheng Dalei that Zhu's village has been destroyed. Cheng Dalei demands to see the place. Upon arriving at Zhu village, Cheng Dalei is filled with shock and indignation as he witnesses the place engulfed in flames and scattered with lifeless bodies. It is revealed that over 30 people, including the elderly, weak, women, and children, were annihilated and the village was full of children and old people, and everyone was killed without mercy. The group of bandits expresses shock and wonders who could be responsible for this heinous act, as they had a peaceful relationship with the people of King New Mountain. Another person states that the attack was carried out by someone from outside. White Wolf interjects, finds the note hanging on a sword, and speculates if it's a blood-stained message left by the mastermind. The bandits are curious about the contents of the notice. White Wolf reads the letter, which reveals that in three days, someone will cross over from King New Mountain. The person demands that the people of King New Mountain surrender one by one and gather at the mountain's foot, or else the entire mountain will be slaughtered. The letter is signed by Lu Heng, who is associated with Blackstone City. In Cheng Dalei's thoughts, he realizes that this act was intended to serve as an example to others. He comments that the lives of mountain bandits are deemed cheaper than a dog's. At Flying Tiger Village, Lauer approaches Gao and informs him that he has added two more posts to the back of the mountain. Lauer suggests that their people take turns on duty tonight. Gao responds by telling everyone to take weapons whenever there's any trouble, reminding them of the importance of being smart. He then turns to their strategist and asks if there are any oversights in their current arrangement. The strategist reassures them that there should be no mistake in the arrangement, as long as they can survive the next three days. Once they pass through the mountain, everything is going to be alright. Gao then reflects on his original plan to rob birthday gifts and let his brothers live through the winter, but he was caught off guard by Liu Hang's cruelty. He asks Lauer for news about Cheng Dalei, but Lauer tells him not to mention him, insulting him by saying that Cheng Dalei was scared to urinate directly and fell ill upon returning to his village. Gao comments that Cheng Dalei is too young and hasn't seen such a tragedy before. He reflects on Liu Hang's cruelty and expresses fear about their current situation. Meanwhile, at Toad Village, Wanner talks about Liu Hang, noting that he even killed children and acknowledges Liu Hang's exceptional skill at what he does. Xing Zai responds that killing people is not something to be taken lightly. Wanner suggests to Xing Zai that they should find an opportunity to leave the current place, as it is no longer safe. Xing Zai agrees and proposes that they leave quietly without disturbing anyone. However, their conversation is interrupted by Cheng Dalei who casually opens their room and tells them that they are still chatting this late at night. Wanner then questions Cheng Dalei why he has come to their room, considering that he is rumored to be ill. She wonders if Cheng Dalei overheard their previous conversation. Cheng Dalei downplays his illness, mentioning that it's only a minor ailment, and expresses his desire to talk with them. Xing Zai asks Cheng Dalei what they will be discussing today. Cheng Dalei asks about the history of the empire. As Lai Xing Zai continues to share his knowledge, Cheng Dalei finally gets a vague impression of the world. He realizes that this world is similar to his previous world, where Pangu opened the sky and Nu Hua created humans. The five emperors ruled the world, and after that, the Xia, Shang, Zhu, and Spring and Autumn dynasties were in chaos. During the Chu and Han dynasties, they fought for supremacy. The Han dynasty established a country for 400 years. However, towards the end of the Eastern Han dynasty, the world was again thrown into chaos and Kong Zhuo was in turmoil. At this time, where history deviates from Cheng Dalei's previous world, there is the name of Cao Cao, but he was caught and killed when he stabbed Dong Zhuo. Thus, he didn't make a big splash in history. Furthermore, there is also no subsequent Three Kingdoms hegemony. Instead, the separation of the 19 states led to the competition in the world. Afterward, history was in a mess, with the 19 countries in constant strife. They were fighting every now and then. After a lot of chaos, Dao Wu founded this empire, and it continues until now. Cheng Dalei was deep in thought as he considered that none of the generals from the Three Kingdoms was in history. Names like Marquis of Wu, Zhuge, Liu, and Zhang did not make an appearance in history. Interrupting Cheng Dalei's thoughts, Xing Zai mentioned that Lai Manzi ruled the Dao Wu Empire with an iron fist until now. On the other hand, Wanner pondered that she's tired from lifting the scroll. Xing Zai continued, narrating how the empire had faced invasions from the Ring tribe about a hundred years ago. The most recent significant battle had occurred 30 years ago. Despite successfully driving out the Ring tribe, 
The Empire had faced ongoing conflicts and skirmishes with them over the years. Wanner highlights the Empire's spending a lot of funds on the border garrisons in just a year but still being defeated many times. She questions Zing Zai about the year of battle against the Ring tribe, wondering why they haven't won. In response, Zing Zai criticized the generals of the border army, referring to them as a group of drunkards who only knew how to scrape by and manage military affairs. This caused Cheng Dali to question Zing Zai's anger. Zing Zai expressed his frustration by mentioning the numerous skirmishes between the Ring tribe and the Empire over the past few years, all resulting in defeats for the Empire. He also pointed out the existence of false reports of military achievements. He further explained that hundreds of people from the Empire had died while managing to kill only around 50 enemy troops, indicating that the Frontier Army was in a mess. Xing Zai turned to Cheng Dale and asked for his opinion on how the Empire could win the war against the Ring tribe. Cheng Dale, feeling uncertain, claimed his ignorance, stating that he was merely a mountain thief. This response elicited a confused reaction from Wan Er. Xing Zai continued, sharing some knowledge he had acquired from an old man who said that the world's armies can be classified into three classes. The lowest class of soldiers fights solely for survival and prioritizes their own lives. When faced with a stronger enemy, they tend to flee. The second class consists of soldiers who fight for certain interests. Their morale soars when they win battles but plunges into panic upon defeat. Xing Zai stated that the first class fights for honor and is proud to die in battle. These individuals form the backbone of an elite class. Cheng Dale questioned Xing Zai about the source of the information he had shared. Xing Zai revealed that an old man had told him about it. Cheng Dale remained silent, seemingly contemplative. Cheng Dale was skeptical and asked if he was certain that the old man was not deceiving him, causing both Xing Zai and Wanner to look at him with a poker face. Xing Zai pondered that the person who had conveyed this information was the current marshal of the empire. Xing Zai then asked for Cheng Dale's opinion, to which he responded that an army fighting for honor is not necessarily the strongest. He explained that an army driven by faith is even stronger, as they share a common belief and are unafraid to die for their faith. Moreover, he claimed that when thousands of such people are in an army, it would be nearly invincible. Xing Zai questioned the existence of such an army and Cheng Dale confirmed their presence, but added that an army fueled by faith is also not the strongest. He asserted that the strongest army was one fighting for survival. Wanner raised concerns that if everyone fights for their own survival, the entire army would be filled with deserters. Cheng Dale explained that running away might not guarantee survival. He used the example of the battles between the Ring Tribe and the Empire to highlight his point. He asked why the Ring Tribe could win many battles while the Empire lost every time. Xing Zai asked Cheng Dale's opinion on the matter, to which Cheng Dale humbly admitted not having much knowledge but offered a vague guess. He asked if they had ever considered why the Ring Tribe invaded the Empire. Wanner chimed in, describing the Ring Tribe as old enemies of the Empire, engaging in continuous warfare for centuries. She characterized them as cruel and uneducated robbers. Cheng Dale countered this view, stating that the Empire viewed the Ring Tribe as demons who had nothing to do but constantly fight with the Empire whenever they were well fed. However, he proposed a different perspective. Cheng Dale pointed out that the Ring tribe suffered from a lack of food and that they resided in the grasslands, relying on breeding animals. Their lives were more challenging than those of the imperial people. He explained that wines can devastate grasslands, turning them into deserts and causing the death of livestock, making it unlivable due to the risk of natural disasters. In contrast, Cheng Dale described the neighboring land as a vibrant empire, brimming with abundant food and women. To him, even if they died fighting the empire, it was preferable to the death awaiting them on the grasslands. Despite this, every member of their army is determined to sacrifice their lives for even the slightest chance to conquer the empire, and the reason the Ring Tribe army fights with such effectiveness is to survive. Xing Zai began by recounting the events that took place 30 years ago when the Ring Tribe invaded the empire. He mentioned that during that time, a severe drought affected not only the Ring Grassland but also several parts of the empire. Over the years, when the Ring Tribe faced good harvests, there would be unrest on their side. However, when their harvests were poor, the scale of Ring Tribe invasions would be larger. Cheng Dale questioned their mindset. The Ring Tribe believed in the certainty of death, whereas the Empire's inhabitants considered retreating to the hinterlands if they couldn't defend the frontier. He pointed out that for the Ring Tribe, not fighting meant starvation, whereas the Empire's side still had the option to escape for survival. He also mentioned the internal conflicts within the military court, 
questioning how the Empire could remain invincible in such battles. Interrupting their discussion, Xing Zai addressed Cheng Dalei with a smile, suggesting that he should return to Jingzhu with him, causing Chen Dalei to become confused and ask why he had to return with him. Xing Zai complimented Cheng Dalei's sharp mind and expressed his belief that Cheng Dalei deserved a better future, suggesting that returning to Jingzhu would offer a great future. Cheng Dalei thinks that he has fooled Xing Zai and that he doesn't have to take any matters whether he's wrong or right. He then looks at Lai Xing Zai, who seems to be serious. Cheng Dalei acknowledges his sincerity as Lai Xing Zai seeks his opinion on important military and civilian matters, leading to a lengthy discussion about improving the Empire's current position. Cheng Dalei ponders that he doesn't want to tutor Lai Xing Zai all day. He awkwardly responds to Xing Zai, stating that he was just flattering him. However, Xing Zai insists that Cheng Dalei possesses great knowledge and could easily obtain a prominent position in the Empire. Cheng Dalei dismisses this as flattery and questions why Lai Xing Zai is persistently bothering him. He makes it clear that he does not want to join the Empire, emphasizing his point by putting down his cup and heading towards the door. But he stops and turns back to Xing Zai and makes a request. He notices the good sword that Xing Zai possesses and asks if he can have it. Xing Zai simply gazes at him from a distance, smiling in response. After that moment, in the evening, Ling Er approaches Cheng Dalei and asks for his help in grinding chili. Cheng Dalei agrees and says he will be there shortly. Meanwhile, Xing Zai is contemplating his sword. He speaks to himself, saying that Cheng Dalei wants his sword. With a smile on his face, Xing Zai opens a small compartment of his sword. Three days later, in King Niu Mountain, General Liu Hang and his soldiers receive a report from their scouts. The soldiers inform General Liu Hang that they have thoroughly explored King Niu Mountain and found no signs of ambushes. Furthermore, all the village masters are waiting for them at the entrance of their respective villages. General Liu Hang, however, requests them to double-check their findings. He wants to ensure there are no surprises waiting for them. In Flying Tiger Village, the largest bandit village in King New Mountain with a population of several hundred people, a bandit spots General Liu Hang's approaching forces and quickly informs the village master. Sounds of horse hooves approaching. Everyone in the bandit village has the same thought, survive the day and mask their emotions as if nothing had happened. The mountain bandits are aware that they are no match for the elite forces of Black Rock City. Gao looked up at General Liu Hang riding on his horse with a sinister smile on his face. General Liu Hang recognized Gao Feihu and questioned his defiant attitude, noticing the sword in Gao's hand. Liu Hang warned Gao to throw away the sword and kneel within ten breaths, threatening to break the stronghold door and slaughter everyone inside. General Liu Hang pressed his weapon against Gao's shoulder, forcing him to kneel. Gao's frustration was evident as he gritted his teeth, but he remained silent. The other bandits called out to Gao, addressing him as their big brother. Gao eventually spoke up, claiming that he was there to accompany General Liu Hang across the mountain. General Liu Hang, seemingly satisfied with Gao's response, allowed him to join their group with a smile. Afterward, in Pearl Blossom Village, the place shifts to the sound of horses' hooves again. White Wolf approached General Liu Hang, bowing before him, and declared her intention to accompany him across the mountain. General Liu Hang told her to raise her head and commented on her beauty and figure, acknowledging her well-deserved reputation. White Wolf, however, maintained a straight face in response to his remarks. General Liu Hang let out a sinister laugh, pointing his weapon towards the forehead of the White Wolf. He acknowledged that the rumors he had heard were indeed true. His weapon slowly approached the chest of the White Wolf, remarking on its size with a sense of awe, while the White Wolf grinned, baring her teeth in grief. The White Wolf's face expressed anxiety as she remained silent. In the same place, the White Wolf's people called out to her, referring to her as the Big Boss. General Liu Hang, having thoughts, urged her to burst out in anger and break free, hoping to have a chance to defeat the renowned Gorse. However, the White Wolf, composed, calmly requested General Liu Hang to cross the mountain. General Liu Hang was taken aback and burst into laughter. He belittled the situation, labeling it as nothing more than encountering a mountain bandit. He called upon their lance man to raise his spear in response to his command. The soldier obeyed and raised his spear with the two heads hanging in it. The lives of mountain bandits are as cheap as street dogs, they belong to the lowest class of the empire, and have no value. In the eyes of the nobles, mountain bandits are not even considered humans. They are just like dogs and cats on the streets. The white wolf and Gao's reaction was one of despair and shock at the same time. Gao, having thoughts, recognizes the heads of the leaders from the Zhu village. While looking back at the place in Zhu village that got ruined, the fate of bandits without the power to defend themselves, even the common people living in cities don't have any mercy for bandits. As General Liu Heng's group passed by the grave of the bandits they had killed from Zhu village, they considered the act of killing bandits akin to cleaning up the filth from the streets, treating them as lowly as colonies of ants. Right when they got to the Toad village, General Liu Heng, seemingly frustrated, 
questions why nobody has come out to greet him. Impatiently, he declares that if the village gate does not open within the next five breaths, they will forcefully break the gate. After a minute of waiting, he suggests breaking in and killing everyone inside. Outside the Toad Village, Gao wonders about Cheng Dali's intentions. He believes that Cheng Dali's previous victory against Black Rock City may have gone to his head. The gate of the Toad Village suddenly opened, and Cheng Dali came out, riding a horse and carrying his weapon. On the other hand, Gao believes it would be better for Cheng Dali not to make things worse and hopes that he allows Lu Heng to pass through as if nothing has happened. Meanwhile, after Cheng Dale emerged from the Toad Village, he suddenly sneezed due to his flu. General Lu Heng swiftly commanded Cheng Dale to throw away his weapon. Cheng Dale remained silent for a moment before finally speaking up, proclaiming that it was a robbery. Outside the Toad Village, Gao wondered if Cheng Dale had not seen the River of Blood in Zhu Village. He also noted that there were several hundred soldiers in Lu Heng's elite troops. Gao wondered why Cheng Dale mentioned robbery. General Lu Heng then ordered Cheng Dale to get off his horse and kneel under his horse. Within five breaths, he would be forgiven. Cheng Dale reacted swiftly, shouting arrow as he raised his weapon. Linger followed by sounding the drum, and Kin Man tightened the big crossbow before releasing it. Suddenly, a swift, large arrow hurtled towards General Lu Heng's group of soldiers, hitting some of them. General Lu Heng ordered the cavalry to scatter while ordering the infantry to defend the carriages. However, even the soldiers with shields still got pierced by the arrows. Amidst the chaos, the soldiers were pierced with the massive arrow, causing chaos and confusion among them. Some called for backup, while others sought refuge behind the carriages. General Lu Heng blocked some of the arrows with his three-stick throwing technique and pondered if they had run out of arrows before giving the command to advance. The soldiers marched fiercely towards the Toad Village. Cheng Dale told Kin Man that he wanted General Lu Heng's head, and Kin Man promised to get it for him. Kin Man charged into the enemy cavalry alone, creating a hole in their formation, and his only goal was Lu Heng. Furthermore, the soldiers who survived fell into the horse pit traps, triggering a hidden arrow trap that pierced all of them. Only the members of the Toad Village were aware of these traps outside the Toad Village, so Kin Man took the safe path while the other paths were filled with traps. The distance of 400 steps between the Toad Village has now become the longest path of their lives. Cheng Dali announced that he had a magical spell and yelled from the sky. Gao, who was just an audience, stated that Cheng Dali was summoning thunder again. In the hiding spot in the Toad Village, Ling'er then beat the drum again, while Shenji and Sen Yun released sacks from above. The sacks suddenly exploded, creating a red fog and splattering the soldiers with dust that made them run and cough. While White Wolf and Gao observed it, White Wolf asked what it was, and Gao replied that it was a red chili bomb. Despite the chaos, the soldiers continue to charge toward the village. Cheng Dale calls Xiao Yu to join him in battle, while Kin Man engages in a one-on-one -on -one battle with General Lu Heng. He swings his spear at Lu Heng, but Lu Heng immediately blocks it. Kin Man then attacks Lu Heng again, causing Lu Heng to drop down from his horse. A soldier starts yelling that General Lu Heng has been killed. After Lu Heng falls off the horse, his men think he is dead, and their will to fight is shattered. Cheng Dale eagerly declares his intent to kill Lu Heng, while General Lu Heng challenges them to come at him. Cheng Dale strikes him with his weapon, and General Lu Heng manages to block the attack. However, the force of Cheng Dale's strike pushes General Lu Heng back. General Lu Heng, with a frustrated face, calls for his soldiers to back him up, but Cheng Dale taunts him, saying that he doesn't have any soldiers left. This statement leaves General Lu Heng stunned and speechless. In his thoughts, General Lu Heng feels humiliated by the fact that his team of elite soldiers was defeated by several people, and they had to retreat. He contemplates the dire situation he finds himself in and realizes that it might be a case of kill or be killed for him. Despite this, he fights until the end. Before he can act, Xiao Yu delivers a strike that causes General Lu Heng to fall again. Cheng Dale then addresses General Lu Heng, mocking him for underestimating the difficulty of invading the Toad Village. He taunts General Lu Heng's claims of power and superiority, stating that he likes to smash those who are stronger than him and kick their faces, sending them flying away. Cheng Dale taunts him to stop playing in the mud. He then points his axe at General Lu Heng's face while calling him a derogatory term and stating that he will spare his life this time. He instructs him to go back and deliver a message to Zhu Ba Chuan. Cheng Dale declares that Zhu Ban Chuan is free to choose any road he wants, but if he intends to cross Toad Village, he will have to face Cheng Dale. General Lu Heng questions Cheng Dale's lack of fear regarding the potential revenge from Black Rock City. Cheng Dale boldly responds by challenging them to come. Inside the Toad Village, Xing Zai and Wan'er were observing the unfolding events. Xing Zai expressed his surprise at how Cheng Dale was able to defeat hundreds of elite troops with only six people. 
Wan Er replied that General Liu Hang had underestimated his enemy and fallen into the traps of the Toad Village, leading to his downfall. Xing Zai recalled a sentence from a poem written by Cheng Dalei and asked Wan Er if she remembered it. Wan Er mentioned that the sentence consisted of only nine words. Xing Zai speculated that if the poem were to spread throughout the empire, many talented writers might stop writing, expressing uncertainty about what would happen if the entire poem were to be written. Meanwhile, Xiao Yu, Kin Man, and Cheng Dalei were shown smiling, and Cheng Dalei smiled and raised his fist in celebration of their victory. On that day, all the bandits of King New Mountain witnessed Cheng Dalei's men pulling carts filled with silver and jewelry back to their village. They pulled ten carts, which were brought inside the village, leaving everyone in awe, and no one from other villages dared to rob them. It was a battle that showcased the strength of Toad Village. In the midst of this, San Yuan informed Cheng Dalei that there were ten carts of gifts, the exact contents of which were unknown, along with several horses. Cheng Dalei instructed San Yuan to bring everything back to the village and also sent someone to bury the head of the village master in their village, to which San Yuan confirmed. At this point, Cheng Dalei called upon the system, and it promptly responded. The system congratulated Cheng Dalei for completing 10 robberies swiftly and remarked that the spoils obtained during these robberies would influence the system's growth. The system then proceeded to review the various items acquired, ranging from copper coins and a rabbit to sticks of wood and a button. It noted that Cheng Dalei had also shown kindness by giving bags of grain and helping someone find their way out of the mountain, causing the system to question him if he was robbing or doing charity. However, the highlight came during the 10th robbery when Cheng Dalei's men managed to secure 10 carts filled with gifts. The system snapped her fingers as the system notified that 10 robberies were completed and trigger conditions were reached. She stated that the new stage is the commander summoning stage, causing Cheng Dalei to react, but got cut in by the system revealing that he could summon a commander when he accumulated 10,000 fear points. As Cheng Dalei returned to reality, he pondered the usefulness of this new feature, realizing that he currently possessed 3,000 fear points and needed an additional 7,000 to reach the required total. The important question in his mind is how he could get the remaining fear points. As the sun sets, Cheng Dalei contemplated conducting an experiment. He then called out to Shenji and playfully spanked his back, startling him. Shenji was irritated and questioned Cheng Dalei's actions, to which Cheng Dalei replied that it was merely a joke. Little did they know, this small interaction resulted in Cheng Dalei gaining one fear point. Following this, Sen Yuan informed Cheng Dalei that he had completed the inventory check. He revealed that three carts contained animal skins, two carts held bronze utensils, two carts carried exotic herbs, and three carts were filled with expensive fabric. Additionally, they had acquired some horses and weapons. However, San Yuan expressed concern about the shortage of food, especially with winter approaching. Cheng Dalei suggested exchanging the acquired items for food, and San Yuan agreed, acknowledging the lack of alternatives. Cheng Dalei mentioned that there was another option, but the strength of Toad Village is diminishing, making it difficult to find someone to exchange those gifts. San Yuan proposed the idea of conducting business with Miss Su's family. Cheng Dalei expressed doubts as they were still awaiting the ransom promised by Su Ying's family, and there had been no resolution to their problems yet. They speculated that there might be trouble on Su Ying's side, and Cheng Dalei decided that he would personally investigate the situation when he found the time. Cheng Dalei pondered the absence of news about Su Ying and questioned the value of Chile in Yuju City, contemplating whether Su Ying's stepmother had caused any trouble for her. The next day, Cheng Dalei went to Xing Zai's room and called his name but quickly realized that both Xing Zai and Wan Er had run away. He found a letter on the table and read its contents, which stated that Xing Zai wrote a farewell letter to Cheng Dalei, hoping that they would meet again someday. Cheng Dalei had always desired a sword, envisioning himself holding one while standing by a river in a white robe, just like a cultivator, but he couldn't get a sword for some reason. In this era, swords held more value in rituals rather than practical combat. The technological advancements in forging had led to the creation of more powerful weapons than swords could be forged. So nowadays, whenever generals head to battle, they mostly choose long spears, bronze axes, or long swords. Most of the big heroes of the time also wielded large weapons. It doesn't matter if their weapon is sharp or not if it's heavy enough to hit several people at once. Swords, expensive and requiring meticulous maintenance, were considered a luxury item primarily used by scholars, famous individuals, and nobles in this era. In Cheng Dalei's thoughts, he pondered Xing Zai's social class, trying to determine which category Xing Zai belonged to. On the official road from King New Mountain to Jingju City, Wan Er called Xing Zai to wait for her. She then questioned why he had left the sword for Cheng Dalei. Xing Zai smiled and replied that it was just a sword, and he had simply given it to him. 
Wen Er, however, emphasized the significance of the sword, pointing out that it was a royal sword. Xing Zai responded with a smile. In the Toad Village, where San Yuan informed Cheng Dalei that there was someone standing outside the village who wished to meet him, Cheng Dalei instructed San Yuan to lead the way. When they arrived at the watchtower, Cheng Dalei was curious about the visitor and asked if San Yuan knew anything about him. San Yuan revealed that the man outside was named Lai Jia and he was the boss of the Wolf Gang, a local gang in Black Rock City consisting of 100 to 200 members. San Yuan expressed surprise since he had no direct contact with the Wolf Gang before, wondering why Lai Jia had come. Cheng Dalei speculated that Zhu Ban Chuan might have sent him to negotiate for birthday gifts. San Yun could not believe it, pointing out that they had previously robbed them, questioning their cooperation with them, given their status as mountain bandits. Meanwhile, Lai Jia thought that they were discussing something among themselves. Cheng Dalei reasoned that Lai Jia might not want to engage in a fight, as he didn't have much time for them. Cheng Dalei stated that Lai Jia usurped his position as the new lord of Black Rock City and subdued rebel forces. With the approaching birthday party of the Yuzhu City Lord, Cheng Dalei asserted that it's best for Lai Jia to quickly redeem the gifts. San Yuan agreed with Cheng Dalei's statement. However, Cheng Dalei pondered why Lai Jia remained outside the village when they posed no threat to him. San Yuan shared a story about Lai Jia's pride, mentioning how once Han Huju wanted to see him, but Lai Jia remained silent for two hours until Han Huju spoke first. Cheng Dalei, with his big smile, confessed his own pride and appreciation for proud people. When San Yuan asked Cheng Dalei if he should come down to offer Lai Jia an invitation inside, Cheng Dalei refused, suggesting that Lai Jia should wait while he took a nap, noting that it was a fine day. Meanwhile, Lai Jia, still standing outside the village, was experiencing the heat and wondered why the backward people preferred to hide in the mountains. While the Wolf Gang conducted business in the city with nobles and dignitaries, considering themselves civilized compared to the mere bandits. A minute later, Lai Jia thought that Cheng Dalei had become rude after defeating Liu Heng. Lai Jia cursed as he wondered why nobody had opened the door for him yet. He speculated whether the villagers were preparing a grand welcoming ceremony for him, considering their behavior impolite. He also wondered if he should mention to those lunatics some tales about the city to broaden their horizons. Lygia also mentioned that the city lord was currently angry, and the consequences could be serious, as they needed to hand over the birthday gifts. In return, the city lord would provide them with some money. As he stood outside, Lygia noticed mosquitoes and flies, causing an itchy feeling. Three hours later, Lygia had been waiting outside the village, feeling frustrated and overwhelmed by the heat of the sun. He cursed silently and sweated too much. Finally, to get their attention, Lai Jia shouted, introducing himself as he wanted to see them. Sen Yuan, noticing Lai Jia's call out, asked Cheng Dalei if he should invite Lai Jia inside. After Cheng Dalei woke up from his afternoon nap and was in high spirits, he thought that Lai Jia would get a heat stroke and suggested letting Lai Jia in to discuss the price Zhu Ban Chuan was willing to offer. Sen Yuan opened the gates, and Lai Jia was glad that the gate was finally opened. He greeted San Yuan, as they hadn't seen each other for a long time, and felt relief as he finally got saved. Inside the Toad Village, where Lai Jia and San Yuan were in the room, Lai Jia was surprised that San Yuan had left Black Rock City and was now working as a bandit. San Yuan clarified that he was no longer a housekeeper but the manager of the Toad Village. Lai Jia expressed his disappointment that he couldn't meet Cheng Dalei. San Yuan explained that Cheng Dalei was busy but offered to discuss any matters with Lai Jia on his behalf. Lai Jia then revealed that Zhu Ban Chuan was willing to redeem the birthday gifts for 20,000 coins and that he would serve as the guarantor. He considered it a great kindness from Zhu Ban Chuan. San Yuan acknowledged Zhu Ban Chuan's high regard for them but disagreed with the amount, stating it wasn't the correct value for the gifts. Lai Jia reminded San Yuan that they had robbed the gifts from Lu Heng, implying they didn't belong to them. San Yuan retorted, highlighting their status as mountain bandits and claiming that what they robbed belonged to them. Lai Jia reacted with surprise and accused San Yuan of shamelessness. At that moment, Cheng Dalei appeared from the doorsteps, wearing a black hooded cape and radiating a terrifying aura, adding an air of tension. Cheng Dalei, with his intimidating presence, decided to take charge of the conversation. He made a bold statement, declaring that they wanted 100,000 coins for the gifts, and asked if Lai Jia agreed or not. Surprised by the amount, Lai Jia yelled in disbelief. In his thoughts, Lai Jia remarked on the terrifying tone of Cheng Dalei's voice. Cheng Dalei expressed his dislike for bargaining and implied that he wouldn't mind if Lai Jia refused to pay. He then walked out while dragging the body of Shenji, who cried out for help, adding tension to the situation. Thinking about the rumor he had heard about Cheng Dalei's alleged cannibalistic habits, Lai Jia felt a sense of unease. In response, Lai Jia quickly agreed to Cheng Dalei's demand. 
Sanyuan confirmed the agreement, stating that Lai Jia needed to bring 100,000 ransom money, and in return, Toad Village would return the birthday gifts. However, Lai Jia expressed concern about arranging such a large sum of money at the same time. San Yuan reassured him, suggesting that he could pay in installments. Lai Jia was unfamiliar with the idea of installments, and San Yuan explained that instead of cash, Lai Jia could use salt, cloth, and grain as payment. He only needed to make a 30% down payment. Additionally, the village would charge a 20% interest on all carts passing through King New Mountain until the full cash amount of 100,000 was paid off. San Yuan proposed signing a contract and then offering a duplicate agreement. After Lai Jia signs it, he can take it to Zhu Ba Chuan for his signature and seal. Once the down payment is made, Lai Jia will be able to take the birthday gifts with him. Lai Jia clarified if they could take back all the gifts once they made the 30% down payment of 30,000 coins. San Yuan confirmed that Lai Jia was correct. Lai Jia then asked San Yuan about the delivery of the money. San Yuan assured him there was no need to hurry and suggested something. Inside another room, Shen Ji asked when they could go out. Cheng Dalei responded, suggesting they wait until San Yuan finished deceiving the leader of the wolf gang. Cheng Dalei mentioned his upcoming trip to Yuzhu City and instructed Shen Ji to accompany him. Shen Ji made a playful remark, asking if Cheng Dalei missed his wife since he was still young. Cheng Dalei explained that there were two reasons why he was going to Yuzhu. One reason was his desire to see Su Ying, and the other reason was that he hadn't been to a city in a long time. On a calm sunny day in Flying Tiger Village, where Gao was fishing, he happily caught some fish, then proceeded to put them in his pot and let them dry so they would last for a while. Suddenly, Lauer interrupted his peaceful moment by shouting his name, which made Gao startle. As a result, the pot of fish that Gao was holding slipped into the water. Lauer, who was running towards Gao, informed him that the toad village had posted a notice again. While Gao was devastated, he just looked at the pot drowning. Gao turned his back to Lauer and looked frustrated, jokingly choking Lauer. Lauer was struggling as he begged for him to stop because he was already choking. Afterwards, Gao set Lauer free. Lauer, who was now lying on the ground, Gao then asked him what had been written on the notice. Lauer informed Gao that the notice stated they should take chili and plant it. It was also written that one kilogram of chili could be exchanged for one kilogram of grain, implying a yield per acre of more than 1,000. Lauer questioned if the information in the notice was reliable. Gao ridiculed the idea, stating that no one would be foolish enough to believe such nonsense. However, Lauer responded, claiming that even the little white wolf from Pearl Blossom Village and the bald head bandits had taken some seeds. Lauer added that he also had some seeds for half an acre and requested Gao to provide him with a place to plant the seeds. But Gao insisted that it was nonsense and stated that they were going to plant a crop of beans for the year. He told Lauer that there was no available free space for him. However, Lauer persisted and asked Gao once again to give him a piece of land. He proposed that he would try to grow chili there, and they could both check if the rumors were true. Gao eventually agreed and gave Lauer the free space in front of the hall where he could plant. Three days later, in the Toad Village, San Yuan called Cheng Dalei, informing him that someone from Black Rock City had sent a person to deliver the down payment of the ransom. Cheng Dalei instructed San Yuan to make an inventory of 10,000 copper coins, salt, iron, and grain. Cheng Dalei expressed his gratitude to General Lu Heng for his patronage, while General Lu Heng reluctantly bowed in response to Cheng Dalei's politeness. The handover process went smoothly. After that, Lu Heng took the gifts directly to Yuzhu City, which showed the anxiety level of Zhu Ba Chuan. On a sunny morning, Cheng Dalei dressed in fine clothes, carried a waist knife, and prepared a thin horse. Then he went to the city along with Zhu Shenji. Meanwhile, in the Su family, two individuals were talking. A person was discussing a man named Huang Yuan Well who was 48 years old and had lost his wife last year without a son or daughter. The person suggested that if she married Su Ying to him, she would be his first wife. The other person expressed concern about Su Ying's age, noting that she was only 17 years old. However, the person dismissed the matter of Su Ying's age, highlighting that her fiancé's family had been ruined and she had been violated by the bandits. The person believed that it was good enough that Huang wanted to marry her. Zhao Yi, the maidservant of Su Ying, stood just outside the room, listening to their conversation. Her expression was sad, while the two individuals inside were simply laughing. In another place in the Su family, Su Ying was feeding the birds when suddenly, Zhao Yi hurriedly ran towards her, calling out for her attention. Zhao Yi informed Su Ying about the old lady's plan to marry her off to an old man with a white beard surname Huang. Su Ying calmly confirmed that she had heard about it. Zhao Yi showed frustration and questioned Su Ying about her decision to marry someone as old as her own grandfather. Su Ying sighed and calmly explained that it was still good enough for her to get married after everything that had happened. 
Furthermore, she emphasized that she would still be the first wife. However, Zhao Yi expressed concern and questioned if Su Ying's heart would truly be happy, causing Su Ying to fall silent for a moment before she confirmed that she was. At the gate of Yuzhu City, a group of villagers read the poster stating that Cheng Dale was a bandit who had been born in a toad village in King New Mountain and his nickname was Toad King. The villagers described Cheng Dale's physical appearance, mentioning his square mouth, wide face, and black beard under his jaw. They also highlighted his cruel and murderous nature, mentioning that a reward of 100 coins would be given to whoever arrested him. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale reacted nonchalantly upon hearing that his bounty had increased. Shenji remarked that the wanted poster didn't resemble Cheng Dale, questioning how they would be able to catch him. Cheng Dale smirked and made the decision to get inside the town. As they were going inside, the guards noticed Cheng Dale's demeanor and stopped him, commenting that he looked suspicious. Shenji quickly intervened, claiming that Cheng Dale intended to have a good time in the city and hoped they could accommodate him. Shenji handed a gold coin to the guards. The guards then asked their names and where they came from. Cheng Dale hesitated briefly, then introduced himself as Oba from a village near King Niu Mountain. He further stated that Shenji, whom he named Aoi and introduced as his uncle, Cheng Dale stated that they were visiting friends in the city. The guards found the surname Oba strange, but they let them enter anyway. One of the guards advised them that since they were from King New Mountain, they should be aware that bandits from there caused trouble for them from time to time. That's why they had to be on alert at all times. Inside the city, Cheng Dale commented on the prosperity of Yuzhu City, while Shenji suggested finding a place to eat first. At Four Ocean Building, where Cheng Dale and Shenji ate, Cheng Dale called Zio Er, who was the owner. Cheng Dale requested Zio Er to bring him half a caddy of wine and two caddies of beef. However, Zio Er politely replied, stating that they did not have beef. Furthermore, Zio Er mentioned the presence of a liquor shop but questioned what Cheng Dale meant by wine. Shenji intervened and took charge, instructing Zio Er to take care of the preparations. He asked to arrange a bedroom for them first. Furthermore, he mentioned that their horses were tied outside and instructed to move them to the backyard and ensure they were well fed. He also requested two pots of Huangju, half a caddy of mutton, half a caddy of pork, and a fish soup to be brought. Finally, Shenji urged Zio Er to complete these tasks quickly. Zio Er accepted the requests and assured Shenji, addressing him as sir, that they only needed a short time to wait. After some time, the food was served, and Zio Er wished them an enjoyable stay, reassuring them that they could call him anytime if they needed something. Shenji handed him gold coins. However, he had a question for Zio Er for a moment, asking about the other dishes they had served. Zio Er responded politely and provided them with a list of the dishes they served, though none of the dishes were particularly noteworthy. Shenji, deep in thought, observed that although Zio Er had introduced more than 10 dishes, the culinary techniques involved were limited to steaming and boiling. Barbecue was absent, and even frying was a rarity. It became obvious to Shenji that the primary objective behind these cooking methods was to save the use of oil and salt. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale thought about the limited items on the menu and recognized a potential business opportunity. He thought about trying different types of food, such as Manchu hot pot, street food, and even beach food. In the midst of thinking, Zio Er seized the moment and mentioned that they had found a new kind of food item, but it was rare. However, the only problem was that customers were not buying it. Zio Er then asked them if they would like to try it. Curiosity was piqued, and Shenji smiled and asked about the ingredients. Zio Er responded, asking them if they had heard about chili. However, Cheng Dale expressed his uncertainty and lied that he had never heard of it. Zio Er responded, clarifying that he didn't intend to play down their knowledge. But, the truth was that even though they hadn't seen the food before, the taste was extremely fascinating. He mentioned that the Lord of Loy City, who, after eating it, had requested half a kilo of chili. But, unfortunately, their store had only 10 kilos in total. Cheng Dale smiled and asked politely about the source of the precious food item, to which Zio Er credited his wife for purchasing it from an overseas traveling merchant, praising his wife for obtaining such a precious treasure. He bet that the food was the only one of its kind in the empire. Zio Er then offered to prepare a dish infused with its unique flavors, but Cheng Dale declined, reassuring Zio Er and mentioning that he had been on fire lately. He instructed him to bring the rest of the food first and assured him that he would catch up later. Zio Er accepted the instruction and stated that he needed to rush now. After Zio Er left, Shenji engaged in speculation about the restaurant, believing it to be connected to the Sihai business. However, he firmly believed that the wife of the Sihai business was definitely not Su Ying. Shenji suspected that the chili had been taken away by Su Ying. He wondered why it was being claimed that someone else had brought it. 
Cheng Dalei asked Shenji why he hadn't brought others with him when he came to the city, but instead chose him. Shenji boastfully replied that it was only natural because of his cleverness and ability to provide advice on any issue. Cheng Dale was annoyed by Shenji's overconfidence. However, he reminded him that their purpose in the city was not to eat, drink, or play but for their missions. He couldn't help but worry as he pondered over Shenji's behavior. Cheng Dale reminded Shenji of the tasks, emphasizing the importance of assessing the situation of the Su family who owed them a ransom. Additionally, they needed to explore the possibility of acquiring slaves to bring a few people back to their base. Cheng Dale asked Shenji's opinion on which mission he could undertake. Without hesitation, Shenji chose the more challenging task of spying on the Su family. Cheng Dale got pissed, cursed Shenji as he instructed him to go to the streets in the afternoon to observe where slave trading took place. Once he confirmed the number of slaves, he was to return immediately to their stronghold to get the money. Shenji, however, added a personal request, mentioning his intention to buy two flower clothes for Ling'er in the city. Cheng Dale granted Shenji's request and poured small chunks of silver into Shenji's hands. Cheng Dale declared that the accounts would be settled when the matter was done. He instructed Shenji to wait for him in the inn. After Shenji received the silver coins, he expressed his lack of understanding of the situation and mentioned that he might not return tonight. He reassured Cheng Dale not to worry. Cheng Dale just remained silent in response to Shenji's statement. After Shenji left, Cheng Dale called out to the waiter, who approached him and politely asked how he could assist him. Cheng Dale hesitated to say it and couldn't think of a word for a moment before the waiter concluded that Cheng Dale's behavior indicated he was looking for a brothel. In a state of shock, Cheng Dale shushed the waiter as he became flustered and asked about the best brothel in Laoai City. In response, the waiter proudly recommended the Huey Yan building. Later that moment, in the Huey Yan building, Cheng Dale thought that he had finally entered the second city, feeling a sense of excitement and determination not to waste the good time in life. Inside the brothel, a woman approached Cheng Dale and commented on his elegance and smoothness, which warmed her heart. Cheng Dale's face was delighted by the ambience, and he noticed a pleasant fragrance in the air. He realized that it was indeed a good place for fun with a lot of people, but before he could continue his words, Cheng Dale's face became serious as he noticed a familiar figure. He swiftly looked back and slowly approached the man. He placed his hands on Shenji's shoulders, calling him. When Shenji turned his back, he was shocked by the unexpected encounter with Cheng Dale. The atmosphere suddenly became awkward after they saw each other in such a place. Cheng Dale's face became flustered and he struggled to find the right words as he was caught off guard. As he was about to continue, Shenji interrupted him, who immediately admitted himself as a sinner and shouldn't have been present in that place right then. Cheng Dale took the chance when Shenji started to blame himself. He then expressed his disappointment and anger as he had trusted Shenji so much to go to such a place. He accused Shenji of using the village's money. Shenji's face turned miserable as he tried to explain that he had only passed by to have a look. However, Cheng Dale cut his explanation short and lied to him, stating that he had been following Shenji and found it hard to believe his excuse. Shenji again admitted that he was wrong and pleaded not to be told by Ling Er, and he promised to leave as soon as possible. But, Cheng Dale sternly replied that he was not unkind either. Cheng Dale delightedly expressed his suggestion that since they were already there, they would just take their time and look at them carefully, trying to examine how ugly they were. As the courtesan started performing instruments and dancing, while others were serving the men, a person started asking if they had heard about a courtesan being ordered again. He continued by saying that the person had made a fortune and been promoted, and also written an excellent poem, and the group of people then started laughing at it. In that era of information lag, rumors were the most important channel of communication. Shenji asked Cheng Dale if he wanted to call an escort with some wine. Cheng Dale calmly replied to him to get lost. A person asked if anyone had seen the notice posted at the city gate. Shenji and Chang Dale were just listening to their conversation. A response came from another person, urging the man to cut the crap. That there was no one who didn't know about the Toad King, Lu Heng, renowned for his formidable character, and no one dared to make a move in front of him. A person hiccuped uncontrollably as he spoke, mentioning the reward of 150 tails for anyone who could bring the Toad King's head, stating that someone would never have to worry about food and drinks in his life. The courtesan then added to the discussion, saying that she had heard that the Toad King was 22 feet tall and carried a 300 caddy axe. A man chimed in, arrogantly silencing them, as he stated that he had heard that the Toad King had learned magic from an immortal and knew five different thunder methods. He claimed that the Toad King possessed a thousand mile vision and a magnanimous hearing capacity, adding that he could hear people talking from miles away, while Cheng Dale became anxious after hearing the conversation. The other man with a silly smile observed their lively conversation and asked if anyone had seen the Toad King. One of the men asked Zhu if he had seen the Toad King. 
a man introduced as Zeus spoke, filled with enthusiasm, and shared his encounter that day when he was passing through the Toad Ridge. Suddenly, he heard a loud cry that caught his attention. To his astonishment, a man came down from the sky, and that man claimed himself as the Toad King. Zu claimed that he had struggled for 30 rounds of fighting against him and he was unfortunate that he got distracted and lost in one move. The courtesans interjected, laughing, and expressed disbelief, comparing him with Liu Heng, who couldn't do anything against the Toad King, and questioning him if he was better than Liu Heng. The other courtesans defended Mr. Zhu's claim that the swordsmanship of Master Zhu's family was excellent, expressing their trust in his skills. Zhu became defensive, stating that he had lacked in his skills last time and had been defeated by the Toad King. He grew serious and vowed that he would wipe out the Toad King for Loy City with his swords in his hands for the justice he believed in. After Zhu made his statement, he heard a chuckle from behind. Zhu turned to Shenji, anger showing on his face, and asked why he had been laughing at him and if he hadn't believed what Zhu had said. Shenji's laughter ceased abruptly, replaced by a puzzled expression, triggered by Zhu's reaction and an unexpected hiccup. He just remained silent. Cheng Dali slightly elbowed Shenji, which made Shenji taken aback by it. Cheng Dali awkwardly smiled at Zhu, making it clear that not only Shenji believed in it but also he didn't believe in Zhu. He questioned Zhu if he had really met the Toad King. Zhu confidently confirmed that he had really met the Toad King and asked who they were for doubting him. Cheng Dali mannerly introduced himself as Oba, stating that people from Jiang who called him the Gentle Hatchet. The crowd of men started to mention Oba with curiosity. Cheng Dali pondered that he had felt awkward when the bunch of roughnecks called him by that name. When Zhu suddenly spoke, laughing, and stated that whoever Cheng Dali was, his interest was only for the lady and asked Cheng Dali if he had also been attracted to the lady's name. Cheng Dali irritatedly replied that he had been interested with a questioning tone, asking what had been wrong with that. The crowd stared to tease Cheng Dali in the vicinity, commenting that he had seemed interested in seeing the lady as well. Some of them remarked on his appearance, suggesting he had been poor and questioning where he had come from. Cheng Dali reacted with a sharp gaze toward them but didn't say anything in response. From the public gossip, Cheng Dali gradually inquired about the lady. Her surname had been Liu, her full name Liu Zhai Hong. The Liu family had also been a big family in Loi City. She had been worthy of the name of the chief courtesan. Her father had worked in the army and had been responsible for protecting the harbor from the pirates, but it hadn't been easy to suppress the pirates all the time. Later, it had been found that he had made secret deals with pirates. In a range, the city master was beheaded by her father and she was enslaved. Liu Zhai, the prime daughter of the Liu family, was sold as an official slave. Cheng Dali went to the place with the intention of buying slaves. Describing Liu Zhai's situation further, Miss Liu would turn 28 years old that year. Although she had been reduced to a courtesan and had gone from an aristocrat to a fourth-class pariah, it was not that no one wished to see her. First of all, you needed a large sum of copper coins as the entry fee. Then, you had to write an interesting poem to amuse her. Only by doing this could you have a chance to enter Liu Zhai's boudoir. There was a curtain covering her. As for how to get Liu Zhai to step out of the curtain, one would offer her a glass of wine and say a few words. If one was successful in making Miss Liu happy, she would say that she was tired and would ask for one to come back the next day. After repeating this three to four times, it was up to fate whether one could finally see each other. Finally, if one wanted to go to bed together, one would have to come up with a lot of money. Even so, there was a steady stream of people who wanted to spend money on it. Moving on, Zhu asked the maidservant of Liu Zhai if the Miss Courtesan was available that day, while Cheng Dalei asked the courtesan to bring him some ink. The courtesan agreed and addressed him as a young master. After a while, Shenji approached and questioned Cheng Dalei about what he was doing, while the man keeping an eye on Cheng Dalei commented that he was dreaming of meeting the lady. While Cheng Dalei was making a poem, he heard a man from a distance complaining about something he had just read. The man cursed and claimed that the literary work was so bad that even children could do better. Cheng Dali just glanced and chose to ignore him. After Cheng Dali finished his writing, he asked for the maidservant as he placed the letter together with the small chunks of silver. Some men discussed the lady's potential choice for the day, noting that Zhu had been present for more than 10 days and questioning how much money he had spent. Another group of men mentioned that they had heard Zhu asking an expert to write a poem but the lady was also known to be a poet herself. After a long period of anticipation, the men were excited as they anticipated the results, some eagerly discussing the imminent outcome. Suddenly, a maidservant came out from the room and bowed in a respectful manner, and called Mr. Wu, who was Cheng Dale, informing him that the lady had invited him. 
This news surprised the group of men, leaving some stuttering and others in disbelief, their faces growing weary from the news. Cheng Dalai smiled and playfully spanked Zhu's back and gestured a peace sign to him, while Zhu's face frowned as he was jealous. Zhu then talked about having been present for over 10 days in a row and mentioned a positive interaction he had with the lady yesterday. A man speculated that Cheng Dalai's success might be attributed to the poem he had written. Zhu was confused and asked what poetry they were referring to, while the other men sympathized with him and told Zhu to stop shaking. Curious about their reaction, Zhu asked what had happened. The men noticed a piece of paper on his back and realized it was an image of a toad frog. The man exclaimed, stumbling over his words, that the image represented the toad king. Some men expressed surprise and fear, asking themselves if the toad king was there. Other men remarked that his warnings had been ignored, referring to his earlier discussions about the toad king's abilities, such as a thousand mile vision and listening. Zhu, with a gloomy face, read the note in the image, which stated it had been eye-catching and pleasing to the ears. As soon as Cheng Dalei entered the room, he heard Liu Jai reciting a poem and asked Cheng Dalei if it was written by Mr. Wu. Cheng Dalei politely requested her to address him by his name, emphasizing his easygoing nature, to which Liu Jai called out his name, and Cheng Dalei responded with a warm, friendly smile. As Cheng Dalei waited and kept his silence in the room, he thought to himself that he should have taken a closer look at Liu, thinking how beautiful a 16-year-old girl was before she grew up. Liu Jai gently reminded Cheng Dalei that it was getting late, but he was lost in his thoughts. He thought that it wasn't early to enjoy bedtime and thought Liu Jai's poetic lines might have meant she wanted to get out of there. Cheng Dalei thought that it was a waste of money to be evicted like this. Liu Jai asked Cheng Dalei what he was going to do, and Cheng Dalei slowly approached her curtain bed. As Cheng Dalei was close enough to be able to open the curtain, Liu Jai pleaded with Cheng Dalei to behave himself as she noticed that the shadow of Cheng Dalei was very close to the curtain. However, Cheng Dalei ignored Liu Jai's plea and still opened the curtain. Liu Jai screamed in shock when Cheng Dalei grabbed the curtain and looked at her. He wondered if the rumors had been exaggerated. He called Liu Jai a little lowly and she looked pretty good, but he needed to ask about her family first. Cheng Dalei told her not to be afraid and that he wouldn't hurt her and urged her not to scream. But Liu Jai found him creepy and pleaded with him to stay away and not touch her. Amidst her screams, a man who had been hiding in the room prepared to attack Cheng Dalei. While Cheng Dalei tried to calm the situation down by saying that there was no need for screaming and that he was a gentleman, a man suddenly jumped behind Cheng Dalei. A loud force fell from Liu Jai's bed, and the man pounded Cheng Dalei on the bed with a knife pointing at his neck and sat on him so he couldn't move. The man asked Liu Jai if he should kill Cheng Dalei. Liu Jai pleaded with him not to kill him. Cheng Dalei just smirked and sarcastically stated that there was already a man in her room. With a stern expression etched across his face, the man introduced as Meng Ziyun threatened Cheng Dalei, questioning the point of talking when he was going to die. Liu Jai, who simply looked at them, remained silent. Ziyun suddenly yelled, die, as he went to stab Chen Dalei's head, but then Chen Dalei shouted, claiming that he could save Liu's family. Liu Jai ordered Ziyun to stop, just in time when the tip of the knife touched Cheng Dalei's neck. But Ziyun expressed his concern, stating that Cheng Dalei knew that he was hiding there and couldn't let the news spread out. Liu Jai pleaded with Ziyun to listen to Cheng Dalei first before making any rash decisions. A few moments later, the tea was served on the table, and Liu Jai was doubtful and demanded to know who Cheng Dalei was and how he planned to save her family. Cheng Dalei calmly replied with another question, asking about Ziyun's presence and questioning whether he could be trusted. Ziyun annoyingly began to speak, but before he could say anything, Liu Jai interjected, explaining that Ziyun was the adopted son by her father and he treated her as his sister. She emphasized her trust in him and the protection he had provided, stating that she had been surviving these days and that he was the person she trusted the most. However, Cheng Dalei, with his frowning face and suspicious thoughts, realized that during the daytime, there was a reward for another person besides him, and concluded that Ziyun was Meng Ziyun, adopted by Liu's father to learn martial arts and serve in the army. After the tragic incident that befell the Liu family, Ziyun too suffered a demotion to the status of a slave. It became apparent that after escaping from prison, he came directly out to find Liu Jai. He suspected Zai Yun's intentions and was afraid he was trying to turn his own sister into a woman he could love since he was already 25 years old and yet dreamed of a little girl. Cheng Dalei insulted Zai Yun as a shameless person. Liu Jai, eager for answers, demanded to know Cheng Dalei's identity. Cheng Dalei responded with a seemingly unusual claim, stating that he was the Toad King from the Toad village of King New Mountains. Zai Yun reacted, labeling him a mountain bandit he hated. 
Liu Jai questioned, specifically asking if he was Cheng Dale. Zai Yun aggressively warned him not to speak nonsense, as the Toad King could defeat Liu Hang in a single move, asked Cheng Dale how Liu Hang had been as useless as him, and threatened to behead him if he continued to lie. In an unexpected twist, Cheng Dale playfully smiled and took back what he had said, knowing he couldn't fool them. He admitted to being a mere commoner from Toad Ridge, revealing his surname as Wu and his names as Oba and Vader. When he mentioned the name Vader, it triggered a reaction from Zai Yun, who realized a connection to his father. Cheng Dale smirked and confirmed, playfully responding to Zai Yun's thoughts as he was his good son. In the midst of the unfolding events, Cheng Dale expressed his admiration for General Liu for his leadership. Although they had never met him, they had admired him for a long time. They had heard that General Liu had been falsely accused and had come to such an end. After hearing about the incident, their leader was very angry. Liu Jai was glad that Cheng Dale, despite being a mountain bandit, knew that her father had been wrongly accused. She believed that justice prevailed in Cheng Dale's heart. Cheng Dale revealed that their leader, referred to as the Big Boss, had emphasized the importance of not letting any harm befall the descendants of General Liu. Consequently, Cheng Dale had been specifically sent to the city to gather information about the situation. He expressed his willingness to save the lives of the Liu family. Curious about Cheng Dale's plans, Liu Jai asked him what he intended to do. Cheng Dale responded by stating that now he had gathered all the necessary information. He would return to the stronghold to gather the money. He planned to use the money to redeem other people and subsequently rescue Miss Liu. Li was stunned for a moment before she could speak up, as she was surprised by the Toad King's kindness. Her voice was filled with hope and a mixture of determination. She cried as she mentioned that if Cheng Dale could save the lives of her family, she struggled to find the right words as she stuttered down and stopped talking. Cheng Dale was flustered in thoughts, taken aback by Liu Jai's words. He wondered if she was willing to commit her body. Liu Jai continued to speak and said that she would become the slave of Cheng Dale and would serve him forever in the next life. Cheng Dale's mind raced, trying to make sense of what Liu Jai had just said. The thought of being born and living again in the next life terrified him. The group of courtesans gossiped about the rumors that were going around about the Toad King being nearby. Other courtesans expressed disbelief and not all the courtesans were convinced. Some expressed skepticism of the claim and some questioned if it was an old man. As the rumors continued to circulate, the group of men discussed Cheng Dale, wondering how long he had been inside. Some men questioned if he had succeeded in his first attempt. While Zhu just looked at Chenji, who seemed to be enjoying his drink, a maidservant then approached Chenji and interrupted his moment. She informed Chenji that the lady had called him for a meeting. Chenji's face was surprised when he learned that the lady had called him, and his face brightened up by the news. He commented that he hadn't expected Cheng Dale to be caring and how it was rare for someone to share their fruits of labor. Meanwhile, the group of men watched Chenji enter the room with jealousy. Zhu entertained the thought of making a joke about the lady having a fetish for three people. Later, when Chenji entered the room, he was greeted by the sword of Zai Yun, which made him frightened. He asked Cheng Dale what was going on. Cheng Dale, with crossed arms, responded by introducing Meng Zaiyun as an underling of General Liu, and stated that Zaiyun didn't trust him. So, he instructed Chenji to take Meng Zaiyun to the stronghold and bring back money to rescue people. However, Chenji asked about Cheng Dale's own plans, and Cheng Dale replied that he had some other business in the city. He told Chenji that he knew how to contact him. Cheng Dale opened the window of Liu Jai and told Liu Jai that when she was rescued, she must keep her promise to become a slave. He then swiftly jumped through the window. In the middle of the night, at the Su family residence, Cheng Dale observed the grandeur of the Su family and thought to himself that it appeared too big. He pondered why a family with abundant land and few people would create so much trouble. With so many rooms in the mansion, he wondered how he would find the boudoir of Su Ying. Suddenly, two ladies walked by and talked about something that made Cheng Dale stop thinking. The lady began to talk, mocking someone and remarking that someone considered herself the young miss of the family. The other lady chimed in, telling that the old man of the family was critically ill, and now his wife held the final say in the family. Another lady expressed her disdain, stating that if Su Ying dared to act like a young miss in front of her again, she would show her ferocity. While Cheng Dale was hiding behind a large rock, he overheard the conversation between the ladies. He concluded that the two ladies must have just come from Su Ying's room. In another place, Su Ying sat amidst a swarm of fireflies on her front deck, tears streaming down her face, when she suddenly caught sight of a man perched atop the wall. Startled, she became nervous and questioned the presence of the man. Cheng Dali slipped from the top of the wall and accidentally fell aloud to the ground. Su Ying was surprised and still remained silent, observing him from the ground. Cheng Dali greeted her with a casual yo, while Su Ying's reaction was horror. She wondered why Cheng Dali was still moving. 
Due to this, it gave 88 fear points from the Cheng Dale mission. Su Ying, still unaware of Cheng Dale's identity due to the late hour, warned him not to come closer and slid back slightly, while Cheng Dale stood up and tapped off the dust from his garment. Cheng Dale, with a big smile, greeted Su Ying first, commented on the long night, and expressed surprise that he wasn't the only one unable to sleep, as Su Ying was also awake. Su Ying finally recognized him and thought whether he was still suffering from the shock. Both were silent for a moment when Cheng Dale presented a gift to Su Ying, saying it was for her and asked if she would like it. Su Ying then smelled it and said that it was a woman's odor, asking him if Cheng Dale somehow met a woman. Cheng Dale started to sweat and didn't know what to say, but he found a reason that he had bought it, especially for her, and the seller was a little girl. Su Ying was suspicious and responded, accusing Cheng Dale of being a liar. Cheng Dale explained that it was a cologne and he had bought it for her, insisting that it was the most expensive and the best. Su Ying responded that she had never worn perfume, which made Cheng Dale curious why she wouldn't. Su Ying exclaimed that she was a naturally charming beauty. Su Ying then shifted the topic and asked Cheng Dale why he was there, to which he responded with a lighthearted remark about how he had been saying his goodbyes to her from King New Mountains and how her beautiful shadow had captured his heart, causing him to lose his will to eat or sleep. He even added that he would never forget her face, even in the slightest moment. However, Su Ying, in contrast, blushed and told Cheng Dale that he wasn't serious. Cheng Dale insisted that he was serious this time and had come specifically to see how she was doing. He even noticed that Su Ying had lost some weight and asked if she had been on a diet. Su Ying gave him a gaze and blushed after she took a glimpse. She did not respond and remained silent. Su Ying was robbed in her wedding dress. Later, the Han family was destroyed. Many people blamed Su Ying for the destruction of the Han family, saying that she was responsible for the misfortune of the Han family. Su Ying was regarded as a bad omen. The Su family wanted to evict her from the house. Even the family servants considered her disastrous. Cheng Dale asked Su Ying about her father's concern if he also didn't care. Su Ying explained that her father was bedridden due to a serious illness and was unaware of what was happening. Cheng Dale remarked on how feudal customs often resulted in killing people. A while ago, when the Ying family was insulting her, a lady referred to her as a scourge and a shame to the Su family, suggesting that she should take her own life. Another lady commented on Su Ying's marriage to Counselor Huang, implying that even her servants wouldn't want her. Su Ying, in response, expressed her sadness silently. In the next set, Cheng Dale extended his hand towards Su Ying's hair, gently caressing it telling her not to be afraid, while expressing his discontent towards those surrounding her and assuring her that he was there for her. He promised to protect her, but Su Ying got flustered by Cheng Dale's words and asked how he could help, to which Cheng Dale replied that she was his wife and he could not allow others to bully her as he stood up. Cheng Dale slowly walked towards the wall and told her to stay where she was and that he would solve all her problems, instructing her to wait for his message as he prepared to leave. Su Ying stopped Cheng Dale just as he was about to leave, prompting him to look back and question what it was that she wanted. It was then that she requested him to take something with him. With a smile on her face, she handed over the cage containing a pigeon to Cheng Dale. However, Cheng Dale politely declined, stuttering slightly as he explained that he had already eaten dinner and expressed that he didn't particularly like roasted pigeons. Su Ying was upset as she explained that she wanted him to have it for communication purposes. Cheng Dale said something that Su Ying couldn't hear when he suddenly jumped to the other side of the wall, and carried the pigeon with him, while Su Ying watched him before he disappeared from sight. The following afternoon, Shen Ji arrived at the meeting place and rushed towards Cheng Dale, informing him that their men were on their way. Cheng Dale asked who else was there. Xiao Yu suddenly spoke, calling Cheng Dale a big boss, while on the other hand, Zai Yun confirmed if Cheng Dale was Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale smirked and affirmed his identity and asked if there was a problem. Zai Yun gritted his teeth and accused Cheng Dale of cheating him, prompting a sudden attack on Cheng Dale who was unfazed by the upcoming attack. However, Xiao Yu intervened by blocking Zai Yun's fist attack with his palm, causing Zai Yun to be pushed back. Zai Yun lashed out at Xiao Yu, angrily calling him a little mountain bandit and questioning how he could have dared to attack him. As Zai Yun was about to unleash his swords to attack Xiao Yu, Cheng Dale demanded him to stop, declaring that it was enough. Cheng Dale irritably told Zai Yun that if he wanted to fight, he could have it anytime. But he emphasized the importance of rescuing people rather than fighting causing Zai Yun to leave with no response. Cheng Dale shifted to their plans, asking Shenji if he had brought the money. Shenji responded, stating they had a thousand pieces drawn by a carriage. Cheng Dale inquired if the amount was sufficient or if they needed more. Shenji clarified, stating that it was enough since a large sum was only necessary for adult slaves. He added that women and children only required a few bucks. The reason behind this decision was to secure the redemption of Liu Jai and ensure a smooth transaction. Cheng Dale decided to redeem the Liu family in the afternoon and instructed them to return that night. 
he asked about the preparations on the road. Shenji replied that he had made a deal with the city guard who would favor them and get rid of the people. Cheng Dalei assigned tasks, stating that he, Shenji, and Kin Man would go to gather other people, while Xiao Yu and Sai Yun would rescue Liu Zhai. Sai Yun stared at Cheng Dalei, deeply contemplating Cheng Dalei's leadership, finding it strange that others obeyed him despite his drunken appearance. As they left the room, Cheng Dalei stated that they would meet outside the city. After a couple of hours, the sun set in the place outside Yuzhu City, where six carriages filled with people had been saved from becoming slaves. The rescued people discussed how Toad Village had saved them, and some wondered if they would become mountain bandits. One person opposed the idea, mentioning that their master had been against bandits, and others stated that it would bring shame to their ancestors. Some expressed their refusal to live as mountain bandits, preferring death over such a life. In a place outside of Yuzhu City, Cheng Dale was getting annoyed listening and suddenly ordered them to shut up. He told them that they were free to die if they didn't want to be bandits. He exclaimed that there were many ways to die and that anyone who didn't know how to use a knife better jump from a cliff or hang themselves on a tree. In an irritated tone, he firmly expressed that it wasn't the time to show loyalty to the country or superiority over others. If they wanted to die, they should help themselves. After a while, Shenji reported to Cheng Dalei that Xiao Yu and others had been gone for so long, and if it continued, they wouldn't be able to get out of the gate. Zai Yun suddenly approached them hastily. Cheng Dalei then asked Zai Yun about the situation, looking at Xiao Yu and Liu Zhai. Zai Yun informed everyone that the Huang family had organized a family dinner. Liu Zhai had received an invitation, but before they could could reach her, Liu Jai was suddenly taken away. He also mentioned that Xiao Yu had requested him to report the news, and he went ahead alone. Shenji told Cheng Dalei that Xiao Yu was in the city and asked if he had a plan for what they would do. He added that if they went back to the city, it would be difficult for them to come out again. Shenji suggested that he knew a secret road that would lead outside the city. He had learned about it when it was mentioned by his master. Kin Man then revealed that he had already anticipated this situation for a long time. He had even brought Cheng Dalei's axe. As Cheng Dalei unwrapped his axe, he smirked and decided to lead Kin Man and Sai Yun. He raised his axe toward the city and dictated to follow him back to the city, stating that it was time to rob. On the night at the Huang family's residence, Xiao Yu was hiding on the wall when others arrived at the place. Xiao Yu noticed Cheng Dalei and asked why he was there. Cheng Dalei inquired about what was happening inside. Xiao Yu informed him that Liu Jai was there and it was Counselor Huang's birthday party, with many important people who had arrived as guests. There were around 70 to 80 families, and more than a dozen people were from the special guard yard. Cheng Dalei told them to move and bring the horse along as they needed to look at the trail first. Meanwhile, at the banquet where the event had started, the courtesans began their performance, while a person commented on Counselor Huang's influence, mentioning that it wasn't easy to see the chief courtesan. Another person expressed gratitude to Mr. Huang for providing the opportunity that day. While Liu Jai was showing elegance in her dance, Counselor Huang drew attention to Liu Jai's dancing, describing it as having a unique taste, and invited the guests to drink and enjoy. An old man remarked that Huey Yan Lu's best item was naturally different from other cheap ones, and a pair of jade feet couldn't be valued in money. Counselor Huang responded by offering the woman to Mr. Wang, if that was his desire, suggesting that he could let the woman share a bed with him that night. Mr. Wang declined the offer, stating that he didn't dare as he was a gentleman and wouldn't seize someone else's opportunity for intimacy. However, Mr. Wang expressed a desire to invite Liu Jai to his house for a banquet in a few days. Later, in another part of the Wang mansion, Liu Jai walked into her room and took off her shoe, exclaiming that she was feeling tired. A maidservant told her to rest there and promised to send someone to take her back once the party was over. Liu Jai calmly looked at the servant without any response. When the maidservant left, suddenly, someone opened the door to her room. Liu Jai asked who it was, and a drunken man appeared. He called Liu Jai babe and complimented her beauty, which revealed that the man was the eldest son of Counselor Huang. Liu, frightened, stuttered as she asked him what he was doing there. The eldest son creepily laughed while he slowly approached her. He then grabbed her hand forcefully and told her that it was obvious that he wanted to have intimacy with her, to which Liu Jai let out a fearful scream. Liu Jai managed to break free from his grip and ran away, but the eldest son followed closely behind, calling her in a creepy way as a little beauty. Despite her attempts to escape, Liu Jai felt the soreness of her ankle and tripped and fell to the floor. A loud thud happened, and the eldest son was able to catch up to her. He grinned a creepy smile while holding Liu Jai back and started to creepily whisper to her, letting her know that he had guards all over the place, making it impossible for her to escape. Meanwhile, outside the room, Cheng Dale and the others started throwing torches into the Huang residence, causing chaos among the people. The officers shouted in alarm, calling out for their master. People started to panic and run for their lives. A man recognized the vicinity and told the people that they should run because that was the Toad King. 
quickly entered the house and broke through the city. Cheng Dale and the others rampaged through the gates. Some people who were caught on their way ducked down with fear, trying to protect themselves. Kin Man and Xiao Yu swung their spears to create space and make way. While the system kept beeping, the fear points of Cheng Dale increased rapidly. The officers felt fear, and some officers even shouted in terror while others called for Shiro's help. As the fear points kept increasing, the officers were knocked down and called out the name of Shiro. Suddenly, Shiro came and assured everyone that there was no need to panic. Counselor Huang and one of the officers were surprised when Shiro appeared. Shiro then told Counselor Huang not to be afraid and declared that he would not let the mountain bandits cause any more chaos. However, just as Shiro was about to launch an attack at Kin Man, Kin Man swiftly countered with a faster swing of his own, striking Shiro forcefully. Kin Man told him to get out of his way and sent him flying. Shiro's soul left his body as he got thrown. The officers panicked and shouted that Shiro was dead. Kin Man and Xiao Yu swung their spears to create a way, while the people felt fear and ran away from them. Back in Liu Jai's room, where she was scared and screamed, she was forcibly undressed by the eldest son of Counselor Huang. When the eldest son irritably asked what all the noise outside was, he stated that he didn't want to be disturbed and told them to work properly. On the other hand, Liu Jai, struggling to find her words, managed to stammer out that someone would come to save her. The eldest son slapped Liu Jai's face and grabbed her hair, telling her that no one could save her as all of his men were outside. Liu Jai was in pain but still insisted that someone would come and kill him, but the eldest son did not believe her that none was coming to save her. But Liu Jai remained stubborn, insisting that someone would definitely come to save her. In response, the eldest son forcefully squished her face, gripping her hair tightly while staring intensely into her eyes and menacingly declaring that after he would have fun, he would see who would come to save her. Suddenly, Cheng Dali's horse burst through the window, causing both Liu Jai and the eldest son to startle. Cheng Dali swiftly charged his horse toward the eldest son while showing his dominance. The eldest son tried to plead for mercy, but it was too late as his blood splattered and reached Liu Jai's face. Liu Jai watched in shock as the eldest son of Huang was killed. She looked at Cheng Dali and called him her big bro. Cheng Dali reassured Liu Jai that she didn't need to worry and told her to go out and wait for him. Liu Jai's face brightened up from crying, knowing she was safe. She handed her trust without saying a word. After a minute had passed, Counselor Huang was cowering in fear, hiding inside a large stock pot. The tension was palpable as he could hear someone approaching him. Suddenly, Cheng Dale discovered his hiding place and confronted him. Cheng Dale, with a cold and determined voice, called out Counselor Huang's name while carrying his axe. Counselor Huang, trembling with fear, pleaded for his life, offering anything in exchange for sparing his life. However, Cheng Dale's anger and resentment did not let him go, especially since Counselor Huang had even tried to marry Cheng Dale's future wife. Without hesitation, Cheng Dale swung his axe forcefully toward the stock pot, causing a devastating blow and shattering it into fragments. Cheng Dale exclaimed, telling him to go to hell. In the aftermath of this merciless act, the system beeped lastly, indicating that Cheng Dale's mission was complete and he had reached 10,000 fear points. The system's voice echoed, suggesting that Cheng Dale could now access the shopping system. After that, Cheng Dale broke the door, set fire to the whole town, and left, causing people to call for the fire to be put out. Cheng Dale and his group rushed out from Yuzhu City. Liu Jai expressed some concern to Cheng Dale, who assured her that she didn't need to worry about anything because he was the leader of the Toad Village. Liu Jai brought up the fact that Cheng Dale had been seen by everyone, but he brushed it off and complimented her, saying that she was nice and smart, which made her smile. Liu Jai expressed gratitude to Cheng Dale for saving her, acknowledging that without his intervention, the consequences would have been disastrous. She reiterated her gratefulness for this favor. Cheng Dale accepted her sincerity, mentioning that she was serious and he knew Liu Jai was famous for keeping her word. Zayun interjected, stating that if she was frightened, they should have gotten off the horse and rested before leaving. Liu Jai responded, assuring Zai Yun not to worry about her, and insisted that they follow Cheng Dale's guidance to head to the Toad Village as soon as possible. Zai Yun expressed concern about Cheng Dale being an outsider and believed that they should not burden him with their matter as it would ruin their reputation. Liu Jai countered by asserting that Cheng Dale was not an outsider. But if Zai Yun thought about her reputation, she assured him that he didn't need to follow her. She added that Cheng Dale seemed to despise her for being weak. Cheng Dale spoke, stating that regardless of his occupation as a mountain bandit, he assured her that she shouldn't worry about anything. She responded, asking why she would look down on Cheng Dale. Zai Yun, who had been silently listening to their conversation, displayed frustration and started contemplating Liu Jai being assaulted by the counselor's son. He thought about how Cheng Dale had come to her rescue and concluded that Liu Jai couldn't help but develop feelings of love towards Cheng Dale. 
Jealousy was written all over his face as Zai Yun pondered that he had watched Liu Shai grow up and saw her getting more beautiful day by day. The foster father mentioned that he would betroth Liu Jai. He worried about how he could watch Liu Jai being deceived by Cheng Dalei and felt the need to get her out of there as soon as possible. Upon reaching Qin New Mountain, Liu Jai expressed that now that they were outside, she suggested to Cheng Dalei that he no longer address her as Miss every day, but rather called her directly by her name or, if comfortable, used the nickname Lei Lei, which was how close acquaintances referred to her. Zai Yun intervened and asked how much further their destination was. Cheng Dalei did not say a word but instead proceeded to process his thoughts as they continued their journey. As they reached the Toad Village, where Ling Er Drum, the Tangu, and the people gathered together, the people from Liu's family wondered why Cheng Dalei had come there for. An elderly member of the Liu family expressed deep concern about betraying his family's loyalty and righteousness for generations by how he had become a thief and questioned how he would face his ancestors in the afterlife. Another person responded, suggesting that they should rest for a few days and wait for the women and children to recover while a few others planned to take measures against the bandits soon. One person called Cheng Dalei a Yuan boy, stating that he could rest assured that in these few days, they would keep the bandits' hideout safe and he didn't need to do everything by himself, just let them take control. Other people refused to become bandits, declaring that they would not follow him in this life. Kid Spokes, calling his father, expressed that he was scared. San Yuan called Cheng Dalei, but before he could finish what he was saying, Cheng Dalei, deep in his thoughts, contemplated the fact that Mr. Liu had managed to recruit over 90 people from the Liu family, stating that their toad village had increased from 6 persons to 96. However, Cheng Dalei needed to make these people loyal to the village and complete system tasks. He realized that he needed to develop the system, which would require more than 6 people. He also noted that he hadn't received the system's new rewards list, recognizing that these people were completely disloyal to him. In order to address this, Cheng Dalei contemplated the need to somehow appease and make them loyal to the Toad Village. He considered those people stupid and needed to get used to them. Cheng Dalei ordered Kin Man to kick Liu's family members out. Kin Man, without hesitation, agreed and leaped from the platform to face the Liu family. The man stated confidently, asserting to Kin Man that he lacked the qualification to mess with him. But he vowed to teach Kin Man a lesson. Recalling their storied past, the man mentioned their past, stating that they had been on the seas, where they had spent decades, making the pirates tremble with fear. He expressed that King Man might not have heard about them in the mountains and asserted that they thought Kin Man was trying to mess with them. As the conversation carried on, other men chimed in, saying that they had been responsible for suppressing bandits in King New Mountain at first. They emphasized that there were currently no bandits to be found in the area. With a sudden burst of energy, Kin Man initiated the confrontation by leaping toward the two men, landing a forceful punch to their stomachs. Kin Man taunted them and exclaimed to bring it on. Kin Man easily defeated them with his fist and taunted them by saying, Have a taste of my fist. The people of Liu's family looked terrified while Zai Yun commented on Kin Man's strength, comparing it to the previous one with a spear, which was Xiao Yu. Kin Man continued to stand confidently while he defeated Liu's family members lying on the ground. The elder man from the Liu family, introduced as Liu Mu Yun, just watched in disbelief without saying a word. Cheng Dalei spoke and said that he was still standing there and questioned whether they thought the legend of the Toad King was fake. Liu Jai approached Cheng Dalei and suggested that they leave. Cheng Dalei, without hesitation, agreed. In the afternoon of the same day, the Liu family was driven out of the Toad Village. Cheng Dalei murmured that he was not as benevolent as simply handing them over to the Toad Village. Angry, Zhu Shenji lamented that the people they had rescued were shameless and ungrateful for asking them to take over their village. Cheng Dalei then mumbled that since they live for their honor, they must also be prepared to die for that honor. He then told Kin Man to remove all the traps nearby because he didn't want to hurt them, and he also told Lin Xiao Yu to go follow them so that other bandits wouldn't hurt them. Cheng Dalei then informed them that the Liu family was branded with slave marks on their bodies, so they can't enter the city and that they have nowhere else to return to. He then ordered Huang San Yuan to relay his message to the people that their village began to recruit people and that those who wanted to join must meet certain standards and should be willing to abide by the rules. After some time, the slaves were resting in the forest beyond the mountain. When a child told his mother that he was hungry, she told him that he should sleep as he wouldn't be hungry when he fell asleep. A man groaned and was asked by his companions why he was crying like a kid. He answered that his legs were hurting. He then wondered why they had to go through it. Everyone then smelled something good that came from the fortress. A man believed that if they were on the Toad Village side, they would have been given a full meal. Another man informed them that they were at the bandit's nest and if they stayed for some time and ate some of their rice, which they got through robbing innocents, they would never be able to forget the guilt. Another voice said that for their child, they couldn't endure it. Liu Mian then thought that his people were confused. 
and that some people preferred honor while others preferred banditry, claiming that it is no surprise that they are only servants of the Liu family. A man mumbled that he had a good meal yesterday, and another man stated that the things called chili were only eaten by nobles in the city. Liu Mian then believed that his people were in disarray and even if they went up the mountain, they would be used by the bandits. He then thought that they had no place left for them to return to and wondered how they could get out of their situation. Huang Senyuan arrived and informed them that tomorrow morning they would start recruiting people, and those who were interested could go to the village for assessment. Liu Mian wondered if it was also one of the Toad Village plans. Meng Zian then informed Liu Mian that he had a plan but was unsure whether it would work. Liu Mian told him to speak up. He then explained his plan, some of their people were very hungry, and if they placed them in front of the gate, he believed that Cheng Dalei would let them in. He went on to say that as soon as Cheng Dalei opened the door, they could send in some old and weak individuals and keep the strong ones for themselves so they could negotiate with Cheng Dalei later. Liu Mian then told Meng Zian that people with lofty ideals were benevolent and that they should not harm those benevolent individuals. Meanwhile, an injured man was asking the Toad Village to open its door as he wanted to join them and become a bandit. Other servants wondered how the injured man could meet their ancestors in the afterlife after becoming a bandit. The injured man then told the Toad Village that he was a lowly servant of the Liu family, and that the Liu family had been destroyed, and that he had become a slave and just wanted to live. The man then thought that they were once invited to the village politely and were offered living quarters and clean clothes, but they chose to refuse for the sake of their honor. He then added that they now wanted to kneel on the ground and knock on the door tirelessly, hoping that it would open. The man felt humiliated, as if bowing and crying would not be enough to get them to open the door, and that he would have to give up his dignity and honor as a human being. After a while, Cheng Dalei realized he respected the Liu family, but he didn't realize they understood human language, which is why he had to go to such lengths. He then believed that begging for food was worse than begging for life. Morning came, and the village door opened, which shocked the group of people. They asked to be taken in, as they wanted to join the Toad Village. Cheng Dalei instructed everyone to line up, as the Toad Village recruitment test had begun. Huang Senyuan then informed them that in order for them to join the Toad Village, they must go through an interview and meet their conditions. A man yelled that he wanted to join the Toad Village. Huang Senyuan asked the man for his name, to which the man answered that his name was Sun Ju. He then asked Sun Ju what his job was before, and Sun Ju answered that he used to cook for his master. Huang Senyuan noticed Sun Ju's injuries. Sun Ju responded that his leg was smashed by a heavy boulder and that he had enough strength to pull his weight. Huang Senyuan then told him that it was difficult for him to decide. Desperate, Sun Ju told Huang Senyuan that he could handle the hard labor and that his leg would not interfere with his work. Huang Senyuan then asked Cheng Dale for his opinion. Cheng Dale responded by allowing Sun Ju to join for the time being, with his level positioned in the C class. Sun Ju thanked Cheng Dale and inquired about the third class. Cheng Dale assured Sun Ju that he would learn about it in the future and told him to see someone to tend to his injuries first and reminded him that if he didn't perform well, he would be kicked out. Lin Xiaoyu informed Cheng Dalei that Lu Heng brought a small group of people over from Loi City. Cheng Dalei then inquired about Lu Heng's whereabouts because he wanted to meet them. Cheng Dalei called Lu Heng and asked why he had returned when he was about to give the king a birthday present. Lu Heng responded that he was back after finishing his work. Cheng Dalei then asked him if his situation was not going well. Annoyed, Lu Heng told him that his job went well. In fact, Lu Heng's trip to Yuzhu City was not smooth, it was terrible. Yuzhu King Yang Longting was the actual ruler of the land, and Zhu Banchuan urgently needed Yang Longting's support after his usurpation of the throne. However, there was one thing Zhu Banchuan didn't know, ten years ago, the wrong clan invaded, and Han who defended the lonely city, buying time for the reinforcements from the rear, and the person who led the reinforcement army at that time was the current Yuzhu King, Yang Longting. Han Hu and Yang Longting joined the army at the same time, fighting in small skirmishes for three years, and they were considered brothers. Yang Longting didn't know that Han Hu was dead until Liu Hang sent him gifts. He learned of his death only after that. Yang Longting accepted the birthday gift, but he killed Liu Hang's messenger. He let him go only so that he could inform Zhu Banchuan. Meanwhile, Yang Longting sent troops to attack Hai Cheng and spilled Zhu Banchuan's blood near Han Hu's grave. As a matter of course, Liu Hang didn't tell Cheng Dalei about his predicament, as he was suffering from a bigger misfortune. Liu Hang inquired of Cheng Dalei why there were so many people in the mountain. Cheng Dalei then informed Liu Hang that their toad village was hiring and offered them favorable treatment, social security, and housing funds in exchange. He then asked if Liu Hang wanted to join them. Confused, Liu Hang assumed that he was Cheng Dalei's enemy. It's not that he didn't want to kill him, but he couldn't turn him into a bandit. Cheng Dalei sighed and told Liu Hang that anyone who wanted to pass through the toad village must pay toll fees. Upset, Liu Hang asked Cheng Dalei to be a little kind to them. Cheng Dalei then told him that if they wanted to pass, they had to pay. 
He had a contract signed by City Master Zhu and asked Lu Hang not to make it a big deal. Lu Hang was becoming more annoyed and told Cheng Dale that they didn't have any money. Cheng Dale then informed him that money wasn't the issue and that he knew Lu Hang had a lot of money. He would take his money and their Toad Village would provide him with an escort service. Lu Hang then reasoned that if the Toad Village provided them with an escort, other bandits would think twice before attacking them. They couldn't provoke the Toad Village again because they were dangerous. He then realized that he didn't have enough money. Cheng Dale then told him that if they didn't have any money, they could just leave two people in exchange. Lu Hang then thought that small mistakes lead to bigger misfortunes in the future. He took out a jade from his pocket and asked Cheng Dale if it would be enough for their toll fee. He promised that it would ensure his men returned home safely. Cheng Dale smiled and told Lu Hang that he would arrange for him to cross over the mountain safely. Lu Hang bowed and thanked Cheng Dale for his help, saying that they would meet again sometime. He then thought that the next time they met, they would be enemies. After some time, Wang Sen Yuan informed Cheng Dale that more than 50 people had joined the Toad Village at the time, but there were now only 30 people left. Cheng Dale then ordered Huang San Yuan to close the stall. Meanwhile, one of the people told his companions that, in his opinion, Cheng Dale was still righteous. Another one mumbled that the Toad Village never treated them badly, even redeeming them from slavery and providing food and lodging. The other retorted that it was because they refused Cheng Dale's generosity. Liu Mayan was listening to his companions and called them out. The next day, Liu Jihan called for Cheng Dale and asked if he could go down the mountain and talk to Liu Mayan and the others, as they were very grateful to him. Cheng Dale responded that he also wanted to talk to Liu Mayan, however, he was busy at the moment and couldn't waste another day. Liu Jihan felt dejected and walked out. Cheng Dale believed that Liu Mayan wanted him to lower his head so he could be satisfied. He then reasoned that he was afraid that at that time, Liu Mayan would have to come up by himself. In the evening, Liu Jihan came back and told Cheng Dale that the Liu family would like to dedicate her to him and that they only hoped, in return, he would be kind to the Liu family and take them in. Cheng Dale inquired as to what she meant by dedicating. Dedicated means that as long as Cheng Dale agrees, he could have ownership of Liu Jihan. And it doesn't mean that Liu Jihan would be Cheng Dale's wife or a concubine, but only an object to be used. Cheng Dale would fully possess Liu Jihan's body and mind, and he could order her to do any kind of thing he wanted, whether it was warming his bed or even selling her to someone else. Cheng Dale then wondered if the Liu family was out of options. That's why they were forced to exchange Liu Jihan for their safety. He thought that as long as he made a good relationship with them, the Liu family would not cause much trouble in order to save the face of the young lady. He then claimed that people always make rushed decisions when they're in panic, and that even though Liu Jihan was reduced to a slave, he shouldn't take advantage of the situation right at the time she was just being used as a bargaining chip. He believed that if he refused them, she would be in a worse situation inside the Liu family. Cheng Dale stood up and patted Liu Jihan's head and told her that he would take in the Liu family. The Liu family had come under the protection of the Toad Village, and they were coming up the mountain in an endless stream. Meng Zian told Liu Mayan that they were now going up the mountain and that it was getting late, and he had not properly rested for some days. Liu Mayan agreed and told him that they would now start moving. After some time, Liu Mayan and Meng Zian arrived at the gate of the Toad Village, which they then noticed by Cheng Dale. Liu Mayan made a stance, took off his headband, and yelled to their ancestors that he would now be coming to join them. He then bashed his head against the ground, which made Meng Zian and the other's jaws drop open wide. Cheng Dale then believed that there are such people in the world who would gladly die for their honor. He then asked Liu Mayan's lifeless body why he had to play the hero. The scholars must not be unyielding and should take responsibility for their people, not just die at their own will. The Liu family couldn't believe that Liu Mayan had killed himself. Cheng Dale believed that with Liu Mayan's death, hatred had taken root in their hearts, and that one day it would become a deadly poison. He then pondered how he could remove their hatred. Cheng Dale instilled fear in the people. He believed that fear points could also be obtained in that manner. Wang Sin Yuan asked for Cheng Dale's orders. Confused, Cheng Dale didn't know what to say in that situation. He then instructed Huang Sen Yuan to bury Liu Mayan's body, take the Liu family to their homes, and asked him to go to sleep. After some time, Cheng Dale had just come out of the shower and noticed Liu Jihong in his room. He then asked her what she was doing in his room, which caused him to gain fear points. Stuttering, Liu Jihong told him that she had prepared warm water for him and had been waiting for him to wash up. Cheng Dale retorted that Liu Jihong might have misunderstood his intentions and told her to go back to her room. Still insistent, Liu Jihong asked Cheng Dale if he didn't need company for the night. Cheng Dale sighed and told her that he didn't need anyone. Liu Jihong asked him if he didn't like her body. Blushing, Cheng Dale then reasoned that Liu Jihong was still young although the marriage age for that era was 14 years old. He believed that he needed Liu Jihong to leave or else he couldn't control himself. 
He then grabbed Liu Zhihong and thought that if she didn't leave he would leave instead. Liu Zhihong cried and told Cheng Dalei that if he doesn't own her she doesn't have anything left to live for. Cheng Dalei then retorted and told Liu Zhihong that she might have misunderstood something about them. Liu Zhihong took a huge needle and asked Cheng Dalei if he didn't like her because she was in a brothel and she drank and danced with others. She then pointed the huge needle in her throat and mumbled that she deserved to die. Cheng Dalei then explained that she misunderstood something and that he doesn't dislike her, she was simply too young and asked her to put down the needle. Liu Zhihong pouted and told Cheng Dalei that she was not young. She went on to say that she knew that Cheng Dalei was an upright person and would never do anything bad to her. However, if he walked out of the room that night, others would think that he despised her. She then informed him that she had saved him when she was a slave. Cheng Dalei then thought that what Liu Zhihong said was not totally wrong and people at that time would believe in superstitions, which could cause problems for her. He then believed that it would work. Both Cheng Dalei and Liu Zhihong lay in bed together. He then told Liu Zhihong that they were going to talk about it first and asked her not to come over secretly as he wouldn't tolerate it. Liu Zhihong called for Cheng Dalei. He then asked if she was still not asleep. Liu Zhihong responded that she had never done anything to serve people. She then asked if he wanted her help with something. Cheng Dalei mused that there was one thing she should pay attention to, drinking more milk in the future. She retorted that there were no cattle in the village. Cheng Dalei then told her to eat more papaya, to which Liu Zhihong had no idea what a papaya was. He then told her to do more chest exercises, of which she had no idea. Cheng Dalei then told her to sleep. After a while, Cheng Dalei kept overthinking and wondered where he was, believing that it was the palace of the system. The system appeared, and she informed Cheng Dalei that it had been a long time since she had seen him. Cheng Dalei was curious about what the system was holding. The system told Cheng Dalei not to mind minor things. She then informed Cheng Dalei that now he could upgrade the village to level 2 to access more options, as he had reached 10,000 fear points. Cheng Dalei couldn't believe it and responded that he had just recently made the Liu family join the Toad village, and there were a total of 98 people in the village, while a total of 100 was required to upgrade it to level 2. A system notification popped up, to which Cheng Dalei read that if he had less than 100 population, he couldn't access the feature. He then asked the system why everything was so difficult to make. The system responded that the requirements for primary structures were simple, while complex structures required higher levels. Cheng Dalei was upset and told the system that she hadn't mentioned it before, believing that maybe she didn't even know about it. The system giggled and asked Cheng Dalei to give her a few minutes, and she would help him activate the banner skills in advance. The magic card then activated. She then informed Cheng Dalei that the recruiting skill cooldown was extremely long and changed with his village reputation. A flag with an image of a toad appeared, and the recruitment was open for grade C. The next day, a person informed Cheng Dalei that two people had come to join them and were waiting near the gate. Cheng Dalei greeted the two strangers and told them that joining his toad village was a great honor for both of them, and that he was naturally honored too. Liao Jia and Liao Yi both greeted Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei then thought that there were two heroes in one system window and that their skills were good enough. He then believed that it could be because his recruiting skill level was too low and wondered if he could recruit more powerful heroes if the banner skills increased. Cheng Dalei assigned Huang Sen Yun to sign Liao Jia and Liao Yi, informing them that they would be part of their family starting that day. A notification from the system appeared, stating that Cheng Dalei's mission was complete and he had now gained one prize draw, and asked if he wanted to draw it. He then mumbled that the village level comes first and asked the system to call the system spirit. The system spirit appeared and informed Cheng Dalei that the world channel building was complete. She then told him that he could now call a hero which was not available in that world from the channel, but it would cost him 10,000 fear points for once. Cheng Dalei pondered how long it would take to accumulate 10,000 fear points. The system assured Cheng Dalei that if his reputation improves, the speed of collecting points would also increase. World channel development completed, the reality rewrite logic chain repair, and the paradox of space and time have been corrected, and the barrier stability open channels started connecting. The system then told Cheng Dalei that the stars from different space and time would cross the world and come to his side. She then snapped her fingers, breaking the chain. The system then told him to lead them and create his own legend during tough times. A system notification appeared, stating that the world channel development had been completed, and the village had been upgraded to a secondary village. It cost him 10,000 fear points in one call, and he got one random hero. Another system notification stated that the village upgrade was completed and all the village skills were upgraded. The system upgraded Toad Village to level 3, and the owner's level increased by 1. With each Toad Village improvement, the owner would be rewarded with one random skill. The system then asked Cheng Dalei if he wanted to draw the lottery as she had just finished. 
Cheng Dali then opened his profile and noticed his eloquent skill, which piqued his curiosity. He also wondered if his speaking ability increased his capacity to debate or deceive. He then mumbled that the first scenario was similar to Prime Minister Zhuge, who started speaking before the battle and stated that he had never seen such a brave man. At that moment, Wang Sidu burped. Throughout the battle, Prime Minister Zhuge continued talking incessantly, while Wang Sidu surrendered even before the fight began. Cheng Dali asked the system if it was that kind of skill. The system responded that it depended on how he would use it, and asked if it wasn't a great skill. Cheng Dali mumbled that he wanted to summon a hero, but the 10,000 fear points were equivalent to all the development costs. He then set his thoughts aside and told the system to draw the lottery. The system excitedly summoned the gacha machine. Meanwhile, below the Toad Village, Xiao Dai thought that Su Ying was also contemplating something, and she was taking all those actions because of Cheng Dali. Now that something had happened, she asked Xiao Dai to find Cheng Dali. Despite the destruction of the Huang family, Su Ying also faced immense hatred but believed that it was not her fault. Xiao Dai added that their master had also expelled Su Ying from the house, providing her only with a restaurant business for support. She sighed and reasoned that Su Ying, being a princess, had to disguise herself in women's clothing and wear a black veil when going outside. She further explained that the restaurant business was extremely poor and couldn't support her at all. Additionally, there were usually troublemakers in the restaurant who tried to sabotage their business. Xiao Dai believed that Cheng Dale was at fault and wondered if he could actually help Su Ying, as she herself had requested to find him. Meanwhile, the system powered up and hit the gacha machine, causing a golden ball to appear. Cheng Dale became curious about the golden ball. The system then mumbled that she had done a great job. Cheng Dali took the golden ball, which produced a massive fire, and a weapon appeared in his hand. A system notification popped up, congratulating Cheng Dali on acquiring the Ghost Face Axe. The system then informed him that the Ghost Face Axe weighs 108 kilograms and was made by the legendary smith Magiakun, with an additional passion skill. Cheng Dali tried to lift the axe, which caused him to drop to the ground as it was so heavy. He then thought that the axe should be a huge improvement over his previous one, However, he couldn't lift his new axe. He then believed that he had to find a way to increase his strength and that, for the time being, he could only leave it. The only thing he could do was scare people with it. After spending some time in the Toad Village, Liu Zhihong asked Cheng Dale if he was hungry and whether he wanted her to cook something for him. Cheng Dale responded that he was not hungry at the moment and asked her about the women's gymnastics he had taught her. Liu Zhihong informed him that she had been practicing a lot. Cheng Dale then asked her to show him how much she had practiced, to which she agreed. She then grabbed her coat, turned around, and asked Cheng Dali about its use. Cheng Dali informed her that it was for her to stay healthy, never lays around during workouts, and that there are people in the world who are less privileged than her but work harder than her. He then advised her to eat well in the future and mentioned that the most important thing for her at her age was development. Blushing, Liu Zhihang told him that she would work hard. The door opened, and a person appeared. Xiao Dai asked what they were doing. The Liu family and Su family were friends with each other, and the young misses from both families were already very close friends. Cheng Dali realized that it was Zai Ho Dai and wondered why she was there. Doubtful, Zai Ho Dai asked Cheng Dali why Liu Zhihong was present. Zai Ho Dai then stared menacingly and noticed that there were two futons on the bed. Liu Zhihong poured tea for Zai Ho Dai. Zai Ho Dai then informed Cheng Dali that Su Ying was thinking about him and commented that he looked happy. Cheng Dale smiled, mumbling that Su Ying also missed him, and asked Xiao Dai how she was. Xiao Dai felt depressed and informed Cheng Dale that Su Ying was in a difficult situation at the moment and that he could see it for himself. She then handed him a paper. Cheng Dale told Xiao Dai that he would send someone to Luo City to pick her up. Annoyed, Xiao Dai asked Cheng Dale if he considered Su Ying just another beautiful girl, and stated that she would never join a bandit like him. She went on to say that the last time he attacked the Huang family, the whole city was searching for him and that he couldn't enter the city at all. Cheng Dale sighed, and then the system told him that the third stage of the young Mrs. mission had been activated, stating that he should help Su Ying run a restaurant and become the number one richest person in Loi City. Cheng Dale then asked Liu Zhihong to call Huang Senyuan, Liao Jian, and Liao Yi, to which Liu Zhihong obliged. Cheng Dale smirked, which prompted Xiao Dai to question him. He then walked closer to Xiao Dai, who asked him what he was doing. He leaned closer and called her name. Terrified, Xiao Dai suspected that the reason Liu Zhihong was sent away was to take advantage of her, prompting her to believe that Cheng Dale had finally revealed his true face. Cheng Dale handed silver to Xiao Dai and told her to use it to buy herself new clothes, asking her not to tell Su Ying about his situation. Xiao Dai sighed in relief. Huang Xinyuan arrived with the others and wondered what was going on. Cheng Dale asked him how much cash their village had at the time. 
Huang Senyuan answered that there were 122 tails of silver. Cheng Dale asked him to bring 100 tails and give it to Xiao Dai. Xiao Dai thought it was too much. He then assured Xiao Dai to take the silver and asked her to go to the warehouse with Huang Senyuan to get it, mentioning that there was silk and satin inside that she could choose and give to Su Ying. Xiao Dai agreed. Cheng Dale then called Liao Jia and Liao Yi and asked them if there was a bounty on their heads. Liao Jia responded that they didn't get the chance to commit crimes. Liao Yi joined in and assured Cheng Dale that the next time they got the opportunity, they would do one or two earth-shattering cases. Concerned, Cheng Dale asked the system if the two brothers were right in the head. He then proceeded to tell them that he would assign them to protect someone from Loi City, someone who would be his future wife. They then told Cheng Dale not to worry, as they would not let any harm befall his future wife. Annoyed, Cheng Dale asked them what they would do if someone bullied their future sister-in-law. The Liao brothers didn't answer, and Cheng Dale told them to squeeze their blood dry. Liao Jia asked him if killing them wouldn't be enough. Time passed, and Cheng Dale requested Liu Jiahong to prepare a pen and ink and started writing his business experiences that he remembered from his previous life. Xiao Dai would deliver them to Su Ying. As he couldn't write in his current world, he asked Liu Jiahong to write it for him. Xiao Dai took the gifts and rushed back, with Cheng Dale personally escorting her until the gates of Loi City were in sight. Meanwhile, store owners in Loi City were attempting to sell their products. Su Ying was writing her income and expenditure and thought that although her store was in a good location, there was a lot of competition with Sihelu Restaurant. A man thought that Su Ying covered her face with a veil even when she was doing business against him. Lai Dadu, the Sihelu restaurant owner, then thought that Su Sihai was seriously ill and would not live for a long time. And as long as Su Ying could be driven out of Loi City, the Su family would be given the name of Lai starting then. He then smirked and claimed that Su Ying was the daughter after all and wondered how long she could live there. A group of men entered Su Ying's restaurant and inquired about her decision to sell her restaurant. Su Ying responded that she had already told them that she would never sell her restaurant to them. The man retorted that he recommended she not be so stubborn and that it was a men's world, not something a weak girl like her could handle alone. Su Ying then told them to get out as they would be closing soon. The other man declined, saying they came to drink and that she didn't have any reason for saying such things to customers like them. Su Ying clenched her brush as she couldn't do anything. She then asked her servant to pour some wine for their customers. The servant poured wine into the customers' cups and apologized for making them wait. The man threw the cup and couldn't believe that a lowly servant served him wine when he wanted Su Ying to pour him a drink. Su Ying was watching what happened. The man then told Su Ying that he had heard she had a pretty face behind her veil, and that he would be going to see what's behind her veil at that time. His other companions stated that Su Ying had been violated by bandits and was still pretending to be a virgin. Liao Ji and Liao Yi arrived and took a jar and bashed it on the man's head, which spooked the other two. They then walked closer to the man and ran with a knife in their hands. When they caught them, they threw them out of Su Ying's restaurant. Liao Ji then told them that if they ever came back, it would not just end with him breaking their legs and arms, while Liao Yi told them to get out. Su Ying looked concerned about the occurrences. Liao Ji then apologized to Su Ying for coming late. Xiao Dai arrived and asked Su Ying if she was alright. Su Ying inquired of Xiao Dai why she had brought Liao Jia and Liao Yi. Xiao Dai then told her that Liao Jia and Liao Yi were the people that Cheng Dale had sent, and also gave them 100 tails of silver and some goods. Liao Jia then informed her that Cheng Dale ordered them to protect her, and if she had any task, they would complete it. Su Ying then told them that it was not convenient for them to talk there. She ordered Liao Jia and Liao Yi to move the goods first, and they would talk after that. She then asked Xiao Dai if there were any problems during her trip. Xiao Dai responded that she didn't have any trouble, and that she encountered some bandits along the way. However, once she mentioned that she came to seek help from the Toad Village, they didn't dare to touch her. Su Ying was relieved that Xiao Dai was alright. Xiao Dai also informed Su Ying that Cheng Dale wrote a letter for her. Su Ying realized that it was a woman's handwriting. Xiao Dai then told her that she had a very sharp intuition. Su Ying inquired of Xiao Dai about what transpired during her journey. Surprisingly, Xiao Dai believed Cheng Dale. However, she did not know what actually happened as she only saw two beds in the room. And it would not be a big problem even if Su Ying really knew that Liu Jiahan was a slave to Cheng Dale. However, Cheng Dale was so close to Su Ying and it could cause a problem later. Su Ying sighed as she couldn't believe Cheng Dale. Moments had passed as Su Ying read Cheng Dale's letter. Xiao Dai told Su Ying that with the silver Cheng Dale sent, the restaurant could be renovated. She also mentioned that the chilies he sent were very popular. Su Ying wondered what Hudi fish was. After some time, in the mainland, Lin Sheyu guided the Liu family in training. They were teaching nothing more than running, punching, and running again. They wore uniform clothing and performed boring and repetitive training. They had to shout some meaningless words during their training, the meanings of which they didn't even know. Seven days later, the Liu family began to show signs of change and became more well-mannered. 
Liu Jiehang called Sun Ji as Cheng Dalei was looking for him. He responded that he would be there in a minute. He wondered why Cheng Dalei always sought him out to talk about things he had never heard before, such as Kung Pao chicken, fish flavor goat, hot pot, and other dishes. He claimed that it was going to be a serious discussion when Cheng Dalei looked for him again. Sun Ju arrived at Cheng Dalei's office and asked if he was looking for him. Cheng Dalei then asked him if he had ever heard of bread. Sun Ju stated that he had never heard of bread before. Cheng Dalei then explained that its shape was like a square of sorts, but it could also be round. It was made by fermenting flour, adding salt, and then baking it. He showed a drawing of a piece of bread, and Sun Ju thought it looked like cake. Cheng Dalei told him that it was not cake and that it was much bigger and softer than a cake. Sun Ju guessed if it was a steamed cake, to which Cheng Dalei responded that it was bigger than a steamed cake. Sun Ju then admitted that Cheng Dalei was more knowledgeable than him, as he had never heard of bread. Cheng Dalei told Sun Ju that he must first make the oven and add fermented wheat flour into it. He then explained further how to make bread. Cheng Dalei mumbled that the key to making bread was an oven and that they would need to make one first. A few moments later, they went to the kitchen. Cheng Dalei then told them that they couldn't make bread like they made steamed cake. Cheng Dalei struggled to remember the contents of the recipe used for making bread and that the method of making bread was not that simple, and making bread in the oven requires a little skill. Sometimes the bread is burnt, and other times it is undercooked. After several failures, the first batch of properly cooked bread was made. Cheng Dalei then told Liu Jihan to try the bread with some ground honey. Liu Jihan took a bite and stated that it was good and that Cheng Dalei must also try it. Cheng Dalei then told them that they should study next how to make the bottom of the pot. At some point on that day, the entire Toad Village tried the new type of food called bread. The unique taste was very popular with everyone, especially with children. Meanwhile, in Loi City, Su Ying asked the man if it really was impossible to hire people and that salary wasn't the problem. A man responded that at the time, salary was no longer a matter of concern, and even if he took money from her, he couldn't hire people and that no one wanted to work in her restaurant. He went on to say that his mother was very old and he was ill, and he didn't think that he could serve her again in the future. Su Ying was curious if the shop manager wanted to leave and if there was any problem. She had enough money to solve it. The shop manager told Su Ying that he regretted leaving her, so he didn't want any money. Su Ying insisted that he was also a family member of the Su family and that if he wanted to go, she would not hold him any longer. She then told him to come to her office to receive his salary. The shop manager asked Su Ying not to force him as he wanted to leave. Su Ying then couldn't do anything. Lai Dadu observed from his window what was happening between Su Ying and her shop manager. The shop manager then bid farewell to Su Ying. Su Ying then realized that she had been forced out of the Su family's house and was given a rundown restaurant. She believed that they must be there to cause some trouble again, as they never gave up. Zio Dai asked Su Ying if she wanted her to go to the market and try to find new workers. Su Ying then told Zio Dai that there was no need for her to go, as no one would agree to work for them. Zio Dai was wondering and asked Su Ying what they should do. Sun Ju arrived and asked if she was Su Ying. Su Ying agreed and asked Sun Ju who he was. Sun Ju then told his companion to come out, as they had already arrived. He then introduced himself to Su Ying. Embarrassed, Su Ying told him to stop calling her sister-in-law in the future. Sun Ju responded that if she needed anything, she shouldn't hesitate to ask them. Su Ying covered her face in embarrassment. Meanwhile, at the Sihalu restaurant, Lai Datu wondered where Su Ying got the money to renovate and reopen her restaurant that day. He then believed that Su Ying must be good at using underhanded methods to obtain money from rich people and claimed that it would not affect his business. He then instructed his waiter to go to the restaurants across the street and inquire if they could lend them chairs since their restaurant had many customers. The waiter responded that he didn't think they would let them borrow their chairs. Lai Dadu laughed and told the waiter that it didn't matter if they agreed or not. He informed them that they didn't need their chairs as they had no customers. He then greeted the Honorable Zhang and invited him inside his restaurant, as he had been waiting for him since morning. Honorable Zhang told Lai Dadu that he wanted a private room and to serve all of his special dishes for his friends, as they had all come from different cities. One of Zhang's companions mumbled that he had heard that the dishes at Lai Dadu's restaurant were all unique. He personally came to check if it was true or just a rumor. Lai Dadu then informed them that he had prepared a room for them on the second floor and asked them to proceed, as he would prepare their order. He then informed Honorable Zhang that the chili they used in their dishes was their specialty made in Loi City, and that they only used fresh ingredients. One of Lai Dadu's servants informed him that there was a problem. Lai Dadu asked him what was wrong. The servant informed him that their chili was out of stock, to which Lai Dadu was shocked and wondered how it happened. The servant told him that their customers mostly came to their restaurant for their special dishes. Upset, Lai Dadu then thought Su Ying was arrogant and definitely had an idea about it. 
He then informed Mr. Zhang that their chili stock had run out and asked him if he wanted to change his order. Mr. Zhang told him not to worry, as he understood that chili was expensive and he was the only one who sold dishes made with chili. He reassured Lai Dadu that he didn't need to worry and that he would pay him as much as he wanted. Lai Dadu then told Mr. Zhang that he was not trying to increase the price and was telling him the truth that they had run out of stock of chilies. Upset, Mr. Zhang believed that Lai Dadu's restaurant was doing great business. He then smelled something and wondered what the fragrance was. He then told Lai Dadu that it smelled of chilies and wondered if he was trying to fool him. Lai Dadu was confused and told Mr. Zhang that the smell wasn't coming from their restaurant. He then wondered where the source of the odor was. Zio Dai was yelling that Hudi Fishing was open, and new customers could enjoy a 20% discount, and there were also snacks to eat. Mr. Zhang told his companions that they should go to Su Ying's restaurant and check it out. Anxious, Lai Dadu asked Mr. Zhang not to leave as he would serve him and his friend's vinegar-flavored fish, which was their signature dish. He then asked his other customers not to leave. Zio Dai was all cheerful as she saw a huge wave of customers. She then noticed Lai Dadu mumbling something about telling his customers to leave and how they wished they had eaten at his restaurant instead. Zio Dai then asked Lai Dadu if she could borrow some of their chairs as they had a lot of customers at the time and they didn't have enough seats for everybody. Enraged, Lai Dadu told Zio Dai that he would never let them lend any chairs. Zio Dai responded that if he didn't want to lend them chairs, he could have just declined, as there was no need to shout, and realized that he didn't have any customers that day. Lai Dadu was caught off guard by what Zio Dai said. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village, Cheng Dale asked Lai Ojia if the situation over Loi City was okay and if she ever missed him. Lai Ojia then told him that Su Ying wrote him a letter and ordered him to deliver it to him personally. Cheng Dale then asked Liu Jihan to read Su Ying's letter to him. The letter that Su Ying sent had only four to six lines, and in the letter, Su Ying did her best to express her gratitude towards Cheng Dale. She was very grateful for the recipes and other things he sent. She also mentioned that she was happy to hear that he had a lovely girl with him and hoped he would have a good relationship for a hundred years. If one day she could meet Liu Jihan again, she would personally congratulate her. Cheng Dale then mumbled that the words in Su Ying's letter clearly conveyed killing intentions and raised questions about women. He then asked for a pen and ink to write a response letter himself. Liu Jihan asked Cheng Dale if he didn't need her to write the letter at the moment. Cheng Dale told her that she could do it next time. He then let the messenger pigeon fly and thanked Lai Ojia for his hard work. He asked Lai Ojia to go back and bring Su Ying's reply to him. If there was a problem in Loi City, he should let him know. Lai Ojia obliged and asked Cheng Dale why he didn't let him deliver the letter to Su Ying. Cheng Dale was speechless in response to Lai Ojia's question. After some time, the messenger pigeon flew into the city and arrived at Su Ying's window. Su Ying caught the bird and took the letter it had. She wanted to know what Cheng Dale's justification was. Her eyes grew wide open after reading the contents of Cheng Dale's letter. Su Ying was perplexed, wondering what he was doing and why the carrier pigeon was there to contact her in case of an emergency, and she couldn't believe he had only sent her three words. She then wondered what Cheng Dale was doing and whether he wanted her to say yes. Zio Dai arrived and told her that Cheng Dale had sent her another letter. Zio Dai was curious about what Cheng Dale had written in his letter, to which Su Ying replied that she didn't know because she hadn't seen it yet. Su Ying's head was full of confusion as Cheng Dale's letter had only one word in it. Another pigeon carrier arrived carrying a message asking if Su Ying had already taken a shower. She then mumbled that it seemed that Zio Dai had to go personally and bring carrier pigeons to raise over the toad village. Meanwhile, people in front of Su Ying's restaurant were debating why there were so many people crammed together and wondering if there was free money there. One person in the crowd said that if they didn't know it yet, Hai Dai Lao opened the day before and was crowded with people, and if they didn't come earlier, there would be no more seats. Su Ying's customers were very cheerful. Sun Ju then told one of Su Ying's employees to remember not to rush and to be polite to their customers, as the hot pot she was holding was hot and she had to take her time slowly. Zio Dai rushed to serve the customers, which resulted in her tripping. Anxious, Sun Ju yelled that he had just advised them to be careful. Meanwhile, Lai Dadu consulted his little sister that things in his restaurant were bad and that Su Ying's business was booming across the street. Lai Dadu's sister then mumbled that Su Ying's shabby restaurant had been abandoned for a long time. She then reasoned that business suddenly came when it got into Su Ying's hands and wondered if she was the reincarnation of Tao Zhu Gong. Lai Dadu then informed her that if she wanted to eat at Su Ying's restaurant, she had to line up long in advance. However, people would still rather queue up than come to their building to eat. She then thought that Lai Dadu was a rip-off and impossible to get rid of. Lai Dadu asked his little sister to think of a solution because if it continued, their Si Hai Long would be the first to close. She then told Lai Dadu that he was useless for not being able to make the business in their restaurant boom. 
Moreover, he couldn't even mess up other people's business. She then asked him to find Du Mao, since it was easier to raise the devil than to control him. Lai Datu, who was perspiring, suggested that his younger sister call Du Mao. He also questioned whether they genuinely desired to get involved with him. She retorted that professionals handle professional affairs and Du Mao only wanted money, which they would give him. Later that day, Lai Datu stood up in front of a huge gate. Sweating heavily, he knocked on the gate and someone opened it from behind. A man with a threatening demeanor asked what his business was. Lai told him that he was looking for Du Mao. He was then told to come inside. The man called Du Man as they were moving through the yard to inform him that his friend from Yuzhu would be arriving in two days and that he had been asked to take care of him. A voice asked what line of work it was. Another voice said that on the sea, he robbed a batch of goods and intended to stay there out of sight. He mentioned having a lot of stuff. A crowd of onlookers gathered around Lai Dadu as he walked, and Du Mao, a man with red hair, was sitting beneath the tree. Lai Dadu then showed his offering and told Du Mao that it was a reward for a little help. Gold came pouring out of Lai Dadu's gift, which made Du Mao's man smile. Du Mao stared at Lai Dadu and ordered one of his men to get it done for them. Ba then happily agreed and told Du Mao to watch him. After some time, Du Mao's men arrived at Su Ying's restaurant and murmured that her business was pretty good, saying that they would go inside to check it out. One of Ba's companions asked him if their food was as good as the rumors suggested. Ba then informed them that they had traveled all over the world and had already tasted dragon liver and phoenix marrow. He wondered what they had not yet tried. He then informed them that they were not in a hurry and would first taste their food before proceeding with their work. Ba's men asked him to excuse them as they ate first. Ba then asked their servers to serve them more meat. A huge number of plates were piled up, and Ba informed his men that they had plenty of food and now they were going to start their business there. He then threw a rat onto their food and exclaimed that it was no wonder the soup tasted great, as it was boiled with rat meat. People turned to look at them. Lai Ojia then told Ba that his trick was old, as they seemed to have poor eyesight, claiming that he had eaten rats after finishing their food. Ba retorted that his eyesight had not been good since he was a kid and that he had already eaten half of the mouse. Leo Yi responded that the rat in the pot was clearly untouched. Ba then took the rat out and stated that they would have to accept it as half finished if he said so, and asked if they would challenge him. Lao Ji and Lao Yi then labeled them as rascals. A voice then commanded them to close the doors and draw their weapons. A large group of people stood up and armed themselves. Sweating, Ba and his companion bowed, acknowledging that they could beat them if they wished, as they had misspoken, and even mentioned that they wouldn't need to bury them if they died from the beating, as it would be their own fault. He went on to say that if they couldn't beat them to death, they must compensate for every punch and kick by giving them silver. His companion pleaded not to be hit. Lai Ojia then asked Su Ying what they should do to Ba and his men. Su Ying responded that they couldn't afford to beat someone and that they had just opened their store without the intention to harm the guests. Ba and his companion quickly ran and told them that within three days, they should close their restaurant and leave Loi City if they didn't want anything to happen. Zio Dai and Lai Yi was left speechless. A man then told them that they were going to see who dared to come into their restaurant. Meanwhile, Lai Dadu's employee told him that the manure vehicle was blocking Su Ying's restaurant, and it turned out it was blocking theirs too, resulting in no business. He then told him that when they go bankrupt and leave, they would no longer have to worry about not having any business, and that he didn't need to be afraid of it. However, a few days later, the culprits who were blocking the door with the manure vehicle were caught. The culprits were beaten, to which Zio Dai told Su Ying that great thieves hang out with the little ones and that they were going to confront them. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village, Lai Ji reported to Cheng Dalei that Du Mao was crazy enough to tell them to close the store, and if it wasn't closed within three days, he would bring people to destroy their building. He continued by saying that while he and his brother Lai Yi were not afraid of Du Mao, they were only concerned that Cheng Dalei's business would not succeed and that they just held their breath in their hearts, waiting for his decision. Zhu Shenji then informed Cheng Dalei that he may not know who Du Mao was, he was no ordinary person. Cheng Dalei then asked what he meant. Zhu Shenji proceeded to inform him that Du Mao once got drunk and beat a fierce tiger to death with his bare fists, and he also had a dozen villains in the city. When they had nothing else to do, they would train together in martial arts. Cheng Dalei then humorously responded, no wonder he was called Du Mao if he beat a fierce tiger to death with his bare fists. Zhu Shenji then told him that some people had joined Du Mao over time, and everyone was recruited. Therefore, he had a high reputation in the business world, and people nicknamed him the Lazy Bug. And in Loy Town, not even the government would dare to touch him, and many people were proud to befriend Du Mao. As long as they managed to build a relationship with him, the mountain bandits wouldn't rob them. Liu Jai was having a cup of wine, which she thought smelled nice. Cheng Dalei then asked him if he couldn't move Du Mao's heart, given that he was so powerful. Zhu Shenji then assured Cheng Dalei that he didn't need to worry and that the matter was quite simple if he were to be asked. Liu Jihan took a sip of the wine. 
He then told Cheng Dalei that Gao Fei Hu and Du Mao had a great relationship and that the two called each other brothers. Every time Gao Fei Hu enters the town, he is received by Du Mao, and they just need to trust Gao Fei Hu's reputation to meet Du Mao, things could be solved. Cheng Dalei then ordered him to go to Gao Fei Hu's fortress and ask him for help. Liu Jiehang got drunk after a sip of the wine, causing her to fall asleep. Cheng Dalei then pondered why Liu Jiehang had been sneaking sips of freshly brewed wine. Later on that day, at the Tiger Village, Zhu Shenji arrived and asked Gao Fei Hu for help, as he was in a rough situation because of Du Mao. Gao Fei Hu responded that Cheng Dalei had robbed Lu Heng to bring honor to Qin Niu Mountain, and helping Zhu Shenji would be a way to return the favor. He then informed him that his second brother would go with them. The next day, at the gate of Loi City, Qin Man then asked Gao Fei Hu's brother if there was any problem with his relationship with Du Mao. The second person in charge responded that he didn't even need to come in person, as passing him a message would be enough for them to get it done. He then asked one of Du Mao's men to tell his boss that Gao Fei Bao was visiting. Du Mao's men then told them to wait, as Du Mao was resting. One of Du Mao's men then noticed Gao Fei Bao and asked why he came and if he wanted to drink flower wine. Another man said that he should be careful of them, as they would judge his head to be worth 120 silver at the time. Gao Fei Bao then told them not to talk nonsense and asked where Du Mao was, as he had something to ask him. He was then informed by Du Mao's men that Du Mao was drunk and taking a nap inside and asked him to wait for a while. They then noticed Zhu Shenji and Qin Man and asked them about their origin and if they were new in the Feihu village, as they didn't look familiar. Gao Feihu then told them that they were friends from the Toad village and introduced Zhu Shenji. A man then became familiar with Zhu Shenji's name, who had a nickname, Jade Face Scholar, and it was said that he was behind the masterful plans for Toad Village's recent hard battles. Another man said that Zhu Shenji's name sounded extraordinary and wondered if he was real or fake. One of Du Mao's men then asked Gao Fei Bao what his thoughts were on how many villages they would be able to beat, and if the Toad Village was so capable. Zhu Shenji mused that it was not easy for him to say. The man then told him what he was worried about and that he could say it with courage if it was hard for him to tell them. Zhu Shenji then threateningly told them that his only concern was that there were too few of them, as they didn't have enough to kill. Du Mao's men were left speechless. Later on, Zhu Shenji was introduced to Du Mao. Du Mao stood up, and Qin Man then told him that their village had asked him to visit and build friendship with him. He then offered him a Buddha statue, to which Du Mao said that he didn't pray to Buddha and didn't even burn incense. He wondered why Cheng Dali sent him a Buddha statue. Du Mao then told Kin Man to take it back, as he had no shortage of friends. He went on to say that dogs had different paths to follow than tigers and that he was not on the same path as the Toad Village. Gao Fei Bao then asked Du Mao that at the moment, it was for Gao Fei Hu's honor. Zhu Shenji stopped the upset Gao Fei Bao and responded to Du Mao's mockery, saying that although dogs have a different path to follow than tigers, mountains and rivers are crossed, and sometimes it's inevitable for them to meet again. He then mocked Du Mao, saying that they would see who's the dog and tiger when the time arrives. Du Mao then told them not to leave empty-handed after visiting and grabbed a huge metal object, throwing it towards Zhu Shenji's group. Kin Man noticed and turned around to catch the metal as he was pushed back by its force. Gao Fei Bao asked Du Mao what he was doing. Zhu Shenji then told Du Mao that they had a long way to go, and it was not convenient for them to bring heavy things. He then asked Kin Man to return the metal. Kin Man threw the metal back, which was caught by Du Mao easily. Du Mao then wished them a good trip. After a while, Gao Fei Bao then told them that Du Mao was too crazy, having so much pride in being almighty on his own. He then complimented Zhu Shenji, saying that even if it's not noticeable, he does have decent skills, to which Zhu Shenji responded that he was too humble. Zhu Shenji then asked Kin Man what was troubling him. Kin Man retorted that he had been careless in causing his arm injury. They then arrived at the Toad Village, and Cheng Dalei inquired Kin Man about how good Du Mao was in a fight. Kin Man responded that Du Mao was not weaker than him and that it was indeed true that he had the ability to fight tigers. Zhu Shenji then informed Cheng Dalei that at the time, thanks to Kin Man's skills, they had escaped. He went on to say that Du Mao also had no respect for them, as he didn't take them seriously. He said that Cheng Dalei was a dog, and he was a tiger, and tigers wouldn't be friends with dogs. Huang Sinyuan also told Cheng Dalei that it was never too late for him to take revenge, but at the moment, it was not the time to deal with Du Mao. He expressed his opinion to hold back for now and wait for an opportunity to get rid of Du Mao. Annoyed, Cheng Dalei responded that they didn't look like gentlemen, and if Du Mao was annoying, they would beat him. Then, he thought that they were being overly friendly and wouldn't tolerate what Du Mao had done. Huang Sinyuan was concerned and told Cheng Dalei that they couldn't fight with their current strength unless he had an idea. Cheng Dalei then told them to get ready as he would personally go into town. 
Later, Gao Fei Bao complained to Gao Fei Hu about how Du Mao would have treated them with respect if they had visited him, instead of being treated like trash. He continued by saying that Du Mao no longer regarded them as friends and was different from before. Gao Fei Hu told him to shut up as he was mumbling like a coward. One of Gao Fei Hu's lackeys told him that Du Mao was disrespectful because of Toad Village, as its reputation wasn't small. Gao Fei Hu asked Gao Fei Bao for their opinion on Toad Village. Gao Fei Bao believed that with Cheng Dalei's temper, they would end up in a fight. Gao Fei Hu smiled and wondered what Cheng Dalei would use to fight Du Mao, as they already had an idea of how skillful Du Mao was. The man suggested to Gao Fei Hu that it might be a good idea to take advantage of the situation and use Du Mao to bring down Toad Village. And if Toad Village lost, they would know how to act in the future. At Toad Village, Kin Man questioned Cheng Dalei about whether or not he really wanted to go with him to Loi City. Cheng Dalei responded that he had already met with Du Mao and that it was not convenient for him to show his face again. Tin Man informed him that his wanted posters were still hanging at the town gate. In response, Cheng Dalei said that he chose people with no bounties and a certain amount of fighting prowess, and that they also needed to think of a way to infiltrate Loi City covertly. He got an idea and asked Kin Man to find some carpenters. Moments passed, and Cheng Dalei's lackeys were speechless. Someone yelled that their toad village would face grief as it was not an option. Cheng Dalei asked Zhu Shenji what was wrong with his plan to break the feudal superstition. Zhu Ling'er and Liu Jihan called Cheng Dalei out of concern. After some time, a carriage arrived in front of the gate of Loi City. They were stopped by the guards and asked what they were doing there. The man said that his grandfather died outside and they had brought his body back to have his bones buried. One of the guards shot back, stating that the bandits were acting rebelliously at the time and doubted that they were not actual bandits trying to sneak into Loi City. He asked them to open the coffin as he wanted to check its contents. Huang Sinyuan offered the guards some bribe money, telling them that the coffin cannot be opened as it would bother the dead. The guards accepted and decided to let them in, as they didn't want to disturb the dead, for which Huang Sanyuan thanked them. Moments later, they arrived at Su Ying's front door and ordered them to carry the coffin inside and never let anyone see it. Xiao Dai noticed and asked the men to leave. The coffin shook, and a hand appeared, making Su Ying and Xiao Dai hug each other in fear. Cheng Dalei threw the coffin cover aside and stood up, wiping his clothes as he was sticky from being inside the coffin. He stepped out of the coffin and greeted Su Ying, as they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Su Ying, bewildered, asked Cheng Dalei for the reason for his visit. Cheng Dalei responded that if she had a problem, he wouldn't dare not to come, even if it is the most dangerous place. Su Ying informed him that living people who sleep inside coffins meet with misfortune. Cheng Dalei ignored Su Ying and ordered his men not to put the coffin in Su Ying's courtyard, as it brings misfortune. He also asked them to bring the wine he had prepared, to which his men obliged. Blushing, Su Ying had a thought that she wanted to ask him about Liu Jihan and the note. However, she didn't know what to say in front of him and wondered what was wrong with her. Her eyes grew wide open as she felt flattered. She informed Cheng Dalei that ever since they blocked her restaurant with a manure vehicle, she couldn't do a thing about it, even after several arrests. They just kept the door closed, and that it was no big deal to her, and she just let them be for a few days. When the time comes, they'll settle old debts and new ones together. Su Ying went on to say that with the few people he brought, she believed that they were no match for Du Mao, and she asked him if he could beat him. Cheng Dalei reassured Su Ying and told her not to worry, as he already had a good plan. Still flattered, Su Ying turned around and ignored him. Confused, Cheng Dalei wondered what was wrong with her. At Du Mao's residence, they were having a party. Du Mao chugged a jar of alcohol, which amazed his men with his capacity for drinking liquor. The other man informed the group that when Du Mao drinks one bowl of wine, his strength increases, and with two bowls of wine, his strength doubles. He added that when Du Mao is drunk, he reaches his full power. He further mentioned that if there were no good wine to cheer him up, it wouldn't have been as enjoyable when he fought the tiger in the past. A merchant came by and yelled that he had wine for sale. Du Mao wondered and asked Ba to see who was disturbing their fun. Ba stood up and agreed to Du Mao's order. He went outside and noticed a merchant selling a bowl of wine. The merchant was receiving complaints from his customers that his wine was expensive. Huang Xinyuan told them that they were being unreasonable, as they had agreed beforehand that a bowl of wine would cost them a hundred, and those who couldn't drink ten bowls in a row wouldn't have to pay. He pointed out that the customers obviously couldn't have done it and were trying to back out of their payment. An angry man told him that he didn't even pay when he ate at a restaurant in the city and asked him what was wrong with drinking one bowl of wine from him. Huang Xinyuan asked them to be reasonable and pay for their drinks. The enraged man threatened him, saying that if he kept talking, he would beat him to death. Ba grabbed the angry man by his collar and told him that if he was an honorable man, he must admit when he had done something wrong and asked him to drink ten bowls of wine. If he couldn't, he should pay for it. The angry man asked who Ba was and told him to drink ten bowls himself if he had the capability. If he couldn't finish, he's a wimp. Enraged, Ba asked Huang Senyuan to give him a bowl of wine. 
Wang Xinyuan poured him a bowl and told Ba to consider the bowl as his gift of thanks. Ba asked him if he meant that he couldn't afford his wine and that he could even pay for ten bowls. Ba drank Wang Xinyuan's wine, which made his eyes widen, and he thought that it was strong. Wang Xinyuan told him that if he couldn't drink, he should not force himself as his wine was pretty strong. The man laughed and told Ba that he wimped out. Ba responded that he didn't wimp out and that the man was the one who wasn't capable of drinking it. He told Huang Senyuan that he'd take him to a place where someone is able to drink 10 bowls of wine and pointed towards Du Mao's residence, doubting if he dared to go with him. Huang Senyuan told him that he only had a small business. Ba told him that they were going to pay him every single penny and that he didn't need to be afraid. Huang Senyuan asked Ba if he could let his people accompany him as he was afraid to go inside. Ba responded that he'd show him what a real man looked like. They got inside Du Mao's residence. Du Mao told Ba that it would be enough if he got rid of them and asked him why he captured them. Ba told Du Mao that Huang Sanyuan was a wine seller and that his wine cost 100 per bowl. If he could drink 10 bowls in a row, he wouldn't have to pay. Du Mao responded that he was interested and asked how good the wine was that made people overconfident. One of Du Mao's men told Ba that he had been drinking and that he couldn't handle the wine. Ba responded that he came across a good wine and wanted Du Mao to try, as he couldn't get drunk from Huang Sanyuan's wine. The men told him to stop bragging as they knew his drinking capacity. The other man mumbled that he wanted to try Huang Sanyuan's wine. He chugged the whole bowl and mumbled that his wine was nothing and asked Ba if the wine could stun him. Ba laughed and mocked the man, informing him that he only drank three bowls in a row. The man was fuming and stated that he just ate too much and was stuffed with food. He asked for another bowl. As the man chugged his second bowl of wine, Du Mao's men were cheering him on. The man couldn't finish the second bowl and fell asleep on the ground. He was made a laughingstock by his companions. Huang Senyuan continued to pour a bowl of wine as Du Mao's men came to chug it. They couldn't believe that his wine was so strong. A bowl dropped, breaking it. The man puked and mumbled that Huang Senyuan's wine was really strong. Du Mao's men were falling one by one, and they couldn't handle anymore, so they asked Du Mao to experience the wine. Huang Senyuan told them that they were just a small business and asked to be spared. Du Mao asked him if he thought they couldn't afford to pay him and also asked him to fill a bowl for him. He said that if Du Mao shoveled a little, he would pay with his head. Huang Senyuan filled a bowl and told Du Mao to take it easy as his wine is pretty strong. As Du Mao was chugging the bowl of wine, Ba told Huang Senyuan that Du Mao won't fall over from dizziness even after a thousand bowls and that when he fought the tiger in the past, he wouldn't believe that he would feel dizzy with only his wine. Du Mao's eyes grew wide as he felt how strong the wine was. Du Mao exhaled and mumbled that the wine was great. Ba ordered Huang Senyuan to fill another bowl for Du Mao as he was just beginning to feel something. Du Mao scolded Ba as Huang Senyuan didn't know anything. He asked Huang Senyuan to fill another bowl for him, to which he obliged. Du Mao chugged his second bowl of wine, as he was drinking, Ba was cheering for him. After he drank all of the wine, he coughed, which made Huang Senyuan advise him that if he couldn't drink anymore, he didn't have to pay, as he felt bad for asking him. Du Mao insisted on filling him another bowl of wine. Huang Senyuan thought that Du Mao was really a warrior when he thought of Cheng Dalei. One bowl could already make him lie on the floor. After a few bowls of wine, Huang Senyuan offered Du Mao another bowl and asked him if he still wanted to drink. Fuming, Du Mao mumbled to fill the bowl up. Huang Senyuan advised him that he should stop if he doesn't want to burn incense and doesn't respect Buddha, as drinking too much wine increases his risk of death. Du Mao's eyes widened as he realized that the man was not a nobody as he dropped the bowl. Huang Senyuan ordered his men to attack. Cheng Dalei and the rest of the Toad Village appeared. He announced that they are doing business and no one who messes with them could leave. His companions were ordered to tie up Du Mao's men and attack him. Du Mao shouted and slapped one of Cheng Dalei's lackeys and proceeded to attack the rest. Lin Xiaoyu leaped and attacked the drunk Du Mao. Du Mao grabbed Lin Xiaoyu's spear and punched him, creating a distance between them. Lin Xiaoyu's whole body trembled after Du Mao's attack, as he was staring at Du Mao defeating his companions. Du Mao grumbled that he was having a good time at the moment. Concerned, Huang Senyuan called for Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei claimed that Du Mao was a drunken tiger. Ba told them that Du Mao was able to capture and kill a tiger and asked them to untie him, as Du Mao would probably listen to him and wouldn't kill them. Cheng Dalei and Huang Senyuan smashed a jar on Ba's head, causing him to fall asleep. Cheng Dalei assured Huang Senyuan not to panic as he would take care of Du Mao. Huang Senyuan believed that Cheng Dalei was indeed a hero, as he would fight Du Mao empty-handed and not take advantage of weapons. Du Mao realized that the one approaching him was Cheng Dalei and mocked him to come closer so he could punch him in the face. Cheng Dalei clapped, creating a noise that bewildered Du Mao. Huang Senyuan and the others were also puzzled by what was happening. Du Mao was still in a trance from hearing Cheng Dalei's clap sound, which made him fall asleep. Du Mao gritted his teeth and charged towards Cheng Dalei, screaming. He punched him, but to his luck, Cheng Dalei dodged. 
Du Mao threw another punch but was still unlucky. Cheng Dali countered and punched Du Mao in the face, making him fall to the ground. Huang Xinyuan and the others' jaws dropped as they couldn't believe that Cheng Dali could also fight. They cheered that Cheng Dali was so powerful, he beat Du Mao in one move. Time passed after the fight, and Du Mao was asleep in a dark room. He woke up and wondered where he was. Du Mao asked who the people outside were and threatened to kill them if he got out. Cheng Dale asked him if he was out of his mind from drinking wine. Du Mao realized that it was Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale mocked him, telling him that it was a pleasure to meet him. Annoyed, Du Mao challenged Cheng Dale if he had the guts. Cheng Dale responded that he was a leader and not trying to play the hero, and that he thought their fight was good. Du Mao was enraged by Cheng Dale's mockery and told him that he had been careless last time, and if Cheng Dale wanted to kill him, he wouldn't resist. Cheng Dale told him that he wouldn't kill him if they had a conversation about recruiting. He asked Du Mao if he would like to join the Toad Village. Du Mao zipped his mouth, and seconds later he laughed, which also made Cheng Dale laugh, mumbling that his laugh was ugly. He told Cheng Dale that he had once been a person with ideals. After a wave of long speeches, Du Mao told Cheng Dale that he wanted him to join the Toad Village if he had the guts to face him head on. Anxious, Cheng Dale thought that Du Mao was not easy to fool and believed that his eloquent skills were useless against him. He believed that the matter of recruiting him would be discussed in the long run. Meanwhile, people were talking about what happened to Du Mao. People were gossiping that they saw Cheng Dale hit Du Mao's head with a palm strike, leaving him half dead. Su Ying thought that after eliminating Du Mao, the Toad Village's influence would expand through the Fallen Leaves City. Du Mao's evil gang could no longer rely on him. A man mumbled that Du Mao had been a bully for years and felt relieved that someone cleaned him up while pouring tea into his cup. He added that Cheng Dale's action against Du Mao proved that he was more terrifying than him. The man he was drinking with responded that he wished all the gangs fighting each other were dead, and that life had been difficult for the rest of the world. The other companion stated that Su Ying had always covered her face with a black veil, and wondered how she looked under the veil, claiming that Su Ying's face must also look good given how good her body was. The man reprimanded his companion, telling him that if he didn't want to live anymore, he didn't have to say what he said and questioned him if he knew who was the one running Su Ying's restaurant. The man asked who it was, to which his companion answered secretly that it was Cheng Dale, which they couldn't believe. The system praised Cheng Dale, stating that he did a great job arranging the people in the streets and alleys of tea houses and restaurants and spreading the news about him, and that he was now famous at the time. Meanwhile, at the Sialu restaurant, someone was gossiping that they had to earn money without resting from morning to night. Lai Dadu told his little sister that they didn't have any customers. The little sister asked why he didn't learn from Su Ying and send someone to steal their recipes if Su Ying was so good at business. Lai Dadu replied that everything was easy to copy from them, however, Hu Dai Lao's business was built on chili peppers, and they didn't have any idea where to find some peppers. The little sister questioned him on where Su Ying got their chili stuff. She believed that it didn't matter if Sihilu's business was good or bad, as long as they got rid of Su Ying and took away their family's property, there would be money for them in the end. She claimed that Su Ying looked like she wanted to take root at the moment. She ordered Lai Dadu to greet their guests as they were coming. Lai Dadu greeted the guest at the entrance and asked Mr. Zhang why he hadn't been visiting their restaurant for a long time, and also wondered what he would like to eat at the moment, and that he would tell the kitchen to serve him some fish stew with bamboo shoots, which was their specialty. Mr. Zhang responded that they didn't come to eat, as they had already reserved a table in the restaurant across the street since there was a queue at the time, and there was no place for them to sit. So he came to their store to rest. Lai Dadu was speechless at what he heard. Mr. Zhang asked Lai Dadu if he minded him sitting at his store with his friend. Lai Dadu stuttered while telling Mr. Zhang that he didn't mind, as he could sit for as long as he liked. Meanwhile, at Su Ying's house, Xiao Dai informed Su Ying that their customers had mentioned having some big business for her. Mr. Zhang introduced his friend from King Zhu and mentioned that they wanted to buy a batch of chili peppers from her. Su Ying informed them that their chilies came from someone else's hands and that she also needed to ask them. She promised to contact them when she had news. An envelope was given to the man and he was instructed not to make any mistakes, as it was an important matter. Mr. Zhang and his friend were willing to pay a high price. After a while at the Toad Village prison, Du Mao was resting in a haystack when he heard footsteps approaching. Du Mao asked for some wine and threatened that if they were even a moment late, he would blow their heads off. The man questioned him if he was really Du Mao. Gao Fei Bao told Du Mao that he would go back and talk to Gao Fei Hu. He suggested that Gao Fei Hu ask Cheng Dale to release Du Mao and advise Du Mao to drink less in the future. Enraged, Du Mao yelled if Gao Fei Bao was insulting him. Gao Fei Bao asked Cheng Dale how he did it. 
Cheng Dali responded by telling him to read more books and newspapers, drink less cold water, and take more cold baths. He ordered Liu Jian to bring him a basin of water. Moments later, he washed his face, thinking that he should always wash his hands and face, burn incense, and take a bath, as being diligent could change fate. Liu Jihan told Cheng Dali that she was going to sleep as she felt sleepy. Cheng Dali called the system, asking it to summon the general. The system appeared and informed Cheng Dali that he currently had a fear level of 20,000. It asked him if the summoning should be done. Cheng Dali asked the system to draw. The system informed Cheng Dali that he was using the beginner ordering platform and that each summon would cost him 10,000 fear points, and he would immediately receive a summon from bad quality to excellent quality. The system went on to say that if he summoned 11 times in a row, every 100,000 fear points, he would inevitably obtain one of excellent quality. Cheng Dale believed that the system was telling him to summon 10 times in a row, as summoning only once was too risky, and that the system was pretty tricky like an unscrupulous game dealer. He reasoned that if he drew immediately, the probability of obtaining ordinary quality was high, and it could also be straight to bad quality, thus adding two little brats to his village. He concluded that it was too hard for him to save 20,000 fear points, and it would actually be quite torturous if he held back from the draw. Cheng Dale told the system to draw, to which the system summoned the summoning general. The system raised her hand, and the summoning general appeared, stating that there were many heroes in the world who were competing in the rise and fall. Cheng Dale laughed at the summoning with special effects. Suddenly, a man appeared to whom the system congratulated Cheng Dale on getting a bad brewer. The man's name was Zhang, and he was an unpopular and bad winemaker. Upset, Cheng Dale thought that despite the brewer's usefulness, his rank was bad and claimed that it was not good at all. He wondered if Zhang would be the one in his favor or would be a burden to him and that he still had 10,000 fear points left, believing that he could try again. He clicked and mumbled that he was going to try one more time. A star burst, and another man appeared after which again the system congratulated Cheng Dale on getting a normal military general. Guan Yu, the man whom Cheng Dale got, was an unpopular, normal military general. Cheng Dale, still disappointed, mumbled that he was, in fact, correct and that after lowering expectations, happiness was much higher. After some time, Cheng Dale sat on a rock, eating bread. He thought that his men hadn't arrived yet and wondered why they were taking so long. Zhang and the others arrived at the front of the toad village, which Cheng Dale noticed. Cheng Dale wondered why there were three of them, as it was supposedly just two. Guan Yu asked him if they were in the toad village. The other companion of Zhang and Guan Yu was named Liu Bei and sighed. Cheng Dale thought the arrival of the two was unsurprising, but he wondered how Liu Bei got there. He believed that it might be the recruitment skill of the village banner that had been activated. He tried to remember the three men's names and realized that they were the three sword brothers Liu, Guan, and Zhang, and that their quality was really degrading for the heroes. Liu Bei greeted Cheng Dale and told him that they came in admiration and hoped to join his toad village. Cheng Dale introduced himself as the toad village master and asked them who they were. Liu Bei introduced Guan Yu as his second brother and Zhang Fei as his third brother and informed Cheng Dale that they had been together since childhood in the peach garden. Cheng Dale reasoned that when they stood together, they looked alike. The system informed him that they were the sworn brotherhood in the peach orchard and that they met in the peach orchard for the common idea of life and death. Cheng Dale wondered if the three men didn't have any relationship with the legendary three, as they had such names and attributes. He asked them where they were from. Guan Yu answered that they lived in Fanyang County. Cheng Dale realized something and asked them if they knew a person named Zhang Fei with the middle name Ida. The three men were puzzled by Cheng Dale's question. Cheng Dale asked them why they wanted to stay in his toad village. Guan Yu answered that the government was looking for them because they had killed the village landlord, who was evil, and that they had heard about Cheng Dale's reputation, so they came to join him. Cheng Dale smirked and thought that he knew they had killed someone, and the legend had it that Guan Yu Cheng had killed the evil landlord and switched to selling green beans. He proceeded to ask them which one of them had killed the man. Guan Yu pointed at Liu Bei, to which he responded that it was not worth it. Shocked, Cheng Dale yelled in his mind that it was Liu Bei who had killed the man. Zhang Fei joined in and told Cheng Dale that he suddenly remembered that the person Zhang Zaidai he mentioned was his great-great-grandfather. Curious, Cheng Dale asked him to tell him more. The three men couldn't remember the names of their ancestors, and it took them a while to recount the story of their ancestors. According to Liu Bei, his ancestor was a very idealistic person who had vowed to become brothers with the ancestors of Guan and Zhang in the Peach Garden. As they took possession of the three weapons, the Mandarin Duck Sword, 
the Green Dragon Crescent Moon Blade, and the Jang 8 Snake Lance, they were determined to sweep the world of rebellion and support the Han Dynasty. However, things didn't go very smoothly as they were defeated while attacking the Yellow Turban Thieves, and later, during the Nineteen Nations Mixed War, they defected to whoever had more influence. In the end, Liu Da Er wandered through the chaos of the world for most of his lifetime, achieving nothing, and the three returned to Fan Yang County when he was 60 years old to settle down. The young men were full of ambition, dreaming of breaking into the world with swords. But when they returned, they were already old and filled with the experience of change in their eyes. And every day, Zhang Yi to open the door to sell pork, Guan Yun Cheng pushed a cart in front of his door to sell mung beans, and after half an hour, Liu Da Er, who sells straw sandals, came. And after sunset, the three would get together and drink day after day. Every day when Liu Da Er was drunk, he would always argue that he was the uncle of Han. If heaven could help the lonely one, how many people in the world would be worthy of being king, and some other topics. The village children often made fun of him as they often saw an old man with white hair and a beard shouting something. Liu Dar would raise his cup to the heavens as he was drinking. Later on, he died at the age of 72. Guan Yun Chang and Zhang Yida also died one after another, and the descendants of the three continued to settle in Fang Yang County. Who could have imagined that if he had been given a stage, the old man with white hair, half crazed and half mad, mocked by urchins, would have been the mighty emperor Liu Bei of Han. And in their generation, Zhang Fei had learned to make wine, and Guan Yu inherited the legacy of his ancestor and liked to read military books. Liu Bei, however, learned the art of medicine from a man named Hua. Future generations of children and grandchildren were always sworn brothers in the Peach Garden. The descendants of the Liu family would always be the eldest. Cheng Dale wondered if those three could be like the legendary Liu Guan Zhang in the future. Cheng Dale sighed and told them that they couldn't help the flood of the turbulent world. As he was walking away, he told them that in the future, they would stay in the Toad Village and would call each other buddies, as there was no need for them to be formal. He turned around and asked them another question if they knew a man named Zhu Ji. The three were still confused by his question. However, they were interrupted as a letter arrived from Su Ying. Cheng Dali read the contents of the letter and thought that business was picking up since there was someone interested in his peppers. He realized that there were 30,000 pounds of peppers in Toad Village and some outsourced pepper seedlings. He concluded that it was the perfect time to harvest. He asked Liu Jian to write a letter for him as his own words were too clumsy. Cheng Dale mumbled that the price could be determined by Su Yin, as she didn't need to worry about the supply since they could provide as much as the customers wanted to buy. He went on to say that they also needed to draft a notice to begin buying peppers at a pound for a pound of origin. After Cheng Dale asked Liu Jihan to write a letter, Liu Bei was talking to a man concerned about his disease in Toad Village. Anxiously, the man asked Liu Bei if his disease was serious. Liu Bei responded that life and death are decreed by fate and that the man didn't need to worry about it. He explained that it wasn't worth it to be concerned about whether it was serious or not. Upset, the man told Liu Bei that he must find a solution for his disease. Liu Bei informed him that his disease was just a cold. The man asked if it was a bad cold. Liu Bei reassured him that it was just a normal cold, leaving the man speechless. The man turned back and mumbled that he still felt bad even though it was just a minor illness. Liu Bei called for the next person. Cheng Dale thought that Liu Bei was an extreme pessimist and worried that it would affect their army if they continued in that manner. Moments later, Cheng Dale confronted Liu Bei and asked if he would mind if he didn't let him work as a doctor in his village. Liu Bei responded that sooner or later, all those who had a life would die, and whether to see a doctor or not was still the same. He wondered why people even competed for fame and fortune when, in less than a hundred years, all people would be mere bones in abandoned graves. Cheng Dale couldn't believe what Liu Bei said and thought that the fight for fame and fortune was still quite interesting. He believed that Liu Bei's communication skills were really strong. He also believed that in the future, he should have less contact with Liu Bei in order not to compromise his own young hero's ambitions. Cheng Dale asked Liu Bei if he could help him handle his difficult matter at the time. Liu Bei responded that Cheng Dale's life belonged to him since they joined the village, and that Cheng Dale could tell him anything. Cheng Dale told Liu Bei to follow him as there was one person he would like to ally with, and he needed Liu Bei's help to convince him. They arrived at Du Mao's prison. Du Mao noticed that someone was approaching as he heard some clattering. He asked Liu Bei if he had bought some wine again, which made Liu Bei sigh and mumble not worth it to Du Mao with a gloomy look. Du Mao was sweating as Liu Bei's look triggered a tingling inside him. Liu Bei sat down and told Du Mao to come near him as they were going to talk. Du Mao shook his head and told Liu Bei to get out as there was no one who wanted to talk to him. Meanwhile, on the front step outside the Toad Village, White Wolf noticed that a crowd was gathering in front of a poster. A man mumbled that a kilo of peppers was traded for a kilo of grain and inquired of his friend how many peppers he had planted in his village, to which his buddy replied, not a single one. Another man muttered that when someone finished planting, the yield of an acre of peppers would be more than ten times that of grain. 
Another man asked him if he thought the poster was telling the truth. The man sighed and responded that it would be nice if it were true and reasoned that there were no such good things. He noticed White Wolf and inquired if her village had planted a lot of peppers, as he had heard. Another man told her that they were going to be rich, and one joined in, saying that they had nothing to worry about in the incoming winter as it would be comfortable for them without worrying about food supply. Annoyed, White Wolf pointed a knife at the man's neck and told him to shut up, and if he kept yapping, she would cut his head off. She walked towards the Toad Village gate and thought that if Cheng Dalei dared to lie to her, she would have him prepared for his death. At the Toad Village, Zhu Linger was cooking, which made White Wolf think that the smell of peppers was quite strong. Zhu Shenji noticed White Wolf and asked her if she was off work, as they hadn't seen each other for a long time. White Wolf told him to call Cheng Dalei as she wanted to settle up with him. Zhu Shenji believed that she might have wanted something romantic, as a woman looking for a man to settle a score was rare. He claimed that Cheng Dalei was fast at such things and didn't even leave an opportunity for him. Zhu Shenji informed White Wolf that Cheng Dalei was in the back. Cheng Dalei greeted White Wolf and asked her if she had eaten. White Wolf asked him if he had forgotten what he had promised her. Liu Jihan was spooked as Zhu Shenji thought that Cheng Dalei and White Wolf really had to spill some tea. Anxious, Cheng Dalei asked her what it was. White Wolf assumed that the pepper field yielded two to three thousand pounds, and the grain yielded only a few hundred pounds, believing that people would think they were insanely poor. She yelled at Cheng Dalei if he had forgotten about his promise after the seeds that he gave her in the past. Cheng Dale blushed and told her that she had to be clear as the reputation of the two villages would be tarnished if word got out. White Wolf scratched her head and informed them that she was just talking about peppers. Cheng Dale replied that she scared him for a moment. He asked White Wolf how many peppers she collected in her village, to which she answered 2,000 pounds. Cheng Dale sighed as the amount was quite little. He told her to send it to him in accordance with the previously agreed upon one pound of pepper and a pound of grain, wheat, or soy, she got to pick out something. He asked her to dry roast the pepper before shipping it to him. Cheng Dale ordered them to hurry up and be ready as first come, first serve. White Wolf looked down, blushing, and reasoned that she didn't expect that Cheng Dale would be so negotiable and that she couldn't do anything about him currently. Cheng Dale turned to look at her, wondering why she hadn't left yet. He believed that White Wolf didn't want to go, as she wanted to talk more to him since it was only logical for women to be attracted to him, as the Toad Village was now considered to be rich and powerful. Cheng Dale tried inviting White Wolf into his room as he composed another poem. White Wolf turned back and ran away, which left Cheng Dale speechless. He scratched his head, mumbled, and reasoned that she might not be into poems and should talk about something else next time. Meanwhile, the men outside the Toad Village asked White Wolf if Cheng Dale had admitted and assured her not to worry about it as it was not a big deal. Another man asked what Cheng Dale had said. She ran, ignoring all the men, and thought that there would be no more hunger in her village in the upcoming winter. The men murmured that the old generations had said that no money falls from the sky. That was why you should learn from your mistakes so that you don't make more of them. The other man said that it was so sad, while the other said White Wolf ran so fast. After a few days, a few more villages that planted peppers came to accuse Cheng Dale. They climbed the mountain in anger, came down the mountain in dismay, and upon their return, they began to roast peppers. She had negotiated a price with the merchant and bought a bucket of peppers for a bucket of wheat. And now they wait and see how much of the stored bell pepper seedling can be harvested. Meanwhile, at the prison, Liu Bei was still working on Du Mao's mind. And according to Liu Bei, it was quite effective. Du Mao sobbed in his prison cell and mumbled that he wanted to die. A few days later, the construction of the new medical center was completed. And with Su Ying's help, they had provided themselves with enough herbs. The system notified Cheng Dale that he was rewarded one medical book after the completion of the construction of the medical center. The Kyanjin formula, created by the king of medicine, could be used by healers with an excellent rank. Cheng Dale read the book and thought it was a hidden quest at the right time, as a gift for Liu Bei. And that Liu, Guan, and Jiang's hidden attitude was on the level of legendary characters and had to be focused on during training. He wondered if the descendant of Emperor Zhao Lai of Han had to be trained as a doctor. On the other part of the mountain, red smoke was covering the entire mountain, which Gao Fei Hu was overlooking. Gao Fei Bao came running towards him and asked Gao Fei Hu if he had heard about something. Gao Fei Bao replied that he had already heard and had no idea the Toad Village would do something crazy. Gao Fei Bao asked him if he thought that it was true. Gao Fei Hu contemplated that he couldn't believe that one hectare of pepper yields ten times as much as other crops, wondering if it was real or not. Gao Fei Bao informed him that they had several pounds of peppers and asked Gao Fei Hu if he should look at them, saying that if it was true, they didn't have to do anything. 
but if it was fake, he would teach the Toad Village a lesson. Gao Fei who ordered Gao Fei Bao to go if he wanted to, as he would give up hope when he arrived, and scolded him that he had already told him not to plant, however, he wouldn't listen. Moments later, at the entrance of the Toad Village, a carriage was fast approaching. The people realized that it was Gao Fei Hu and wondered if the Tiger Village had also planted peppers. A man asked Gao Fei Bao what he was doing, as he remembered that it was he who had told them not to plant peppers and claimed that he secretly took seeds to plant. Gao Fei Bao retorted that he only wanted to expose the Toad Village lies and that he was transporting peppers to them at the time, and that if they didn't give grains, he wanted to see what excuse they would come up with. A man joined in their conversation and praised Gao Fei Bao for his smart move. Gao Fei Bao invited the people to climb the mountain together to hear Cheng Dale's explanation, to which the crowd happily agreed. Wang Xinyuan noticed the approaching crowd and asked Cheng Dale if they were about to start a fight, and if they needed to call for backup. Cheng Dali assured him not to panic. Gao Fei Bao got down from his horse and told Huang Senyuan that they were visiting to exchange grain, and that what he said must be counted. Huang Senyuan checked the bag of peppers Gao Fei Bao bought and told him that he forgot to fry the peppers. Gao Fei Bao pointed at Huang Senyuan and asked him if he wanted him to fry the peppers at the moment. Cheng Dali told Huang Senyuan not to let Gao Fei Bao's trip go for nothing, and that it's not much work for them to fry the peppers themselves, to which Huang Senyuan agreed. Huang Senyuan ordered their men to unload the goods that Gao Fei Bao bought and give him some grain. Gao Fei Bao was taken aback by what Huang Senyuan was saying. Huang Senyuan informed him that they had agreed to give him the grain and asked if he had any concerns, to which Gao Fei Bao responded that he had none. The men unloaded a few sacks of peppers and loaded grains onto Gao Fei Bao's cart. The crowd's mouths were wide open as they couldn't believe it. One man accused Gao Fei Bao of being the one who told them not to plant peppers before and claimed that the tiger village was deceitful. Gao Fei Bao asked the man if he didn't listen to what Cheng Dale said, that they were only giving their village the grain because they were being honored. Gao Fei Bao also mentioned that they planted a few peppers, claiming that it was far better to satisfy them with a few hundred pounds than to give everyone else grains. Moments later, another cart arrived, which made Cheng Dale notice the arrival of White Wolf and her gang bringing with them tons of peppers. A voice announced White Wolf's arrival and ordered their men to help them unload their peppers in exchange for grain. The enraged crowd lambasted Gao Fei Hu, asking him if the Xing Hua rides were also honored by the Toad Village, as they also planted less pepper. White Wolf's subordinates admired Cheng Dale, stating that he was handsome. Cheng Dale was proud and told the girls that he had kept it for so long. He was surrounded by a lot of women who consistently complimented his appearance, asking him why he wasn't visiting their village, as many people wanted to see his face. Cheng Dale giggled as he flirted with White Wolf's subordinates. White Wolf told her companions to go away as she had something to discuss with him. She asked Cheng Dale if she could leave the grain with him first, as she would come back later when she needed it. Puzzled by the sudden question, Cheng Dale asked her if she couldn't get it herself. White Wolf responded that she was afraid she couldn't defend the food in their village. Cheng Dale thought about the sudden requests and eventually agreed, stating that she could take away a part of it for the time being, and that he would mark the others, so if she needed it, she would only need to pick the marked ones. White Wolf agreed to Cheng Dale's suggestion. After Gao Fei Bao's appointment at the Toad Village, he returned to Tiger Village and reported to Gao Fei Hu to take a look at what he had bought. Gao Fei Hu asked him what there was to see, as there was no interest in pulling back the old things, and that he would talk to Cheng Dale about his mistake some other time. Gao Fei Bao stabbed the sack he had bought, and grains poured out of it. Shocked, Gao Fei Hu couldn't believe that Cheng Dale had really exchanged. Gao Fei Bao told his brother that an adequate amount of grain was sufficient because they did not profit at the expense of others, and asked him if it looked fake. He went on to inform that Xing Hua Ridge exchanged at least a thousand pounds of grain, and luckily he bought some seeds to plant back peppers, or they wouldn't have taken advantage of their situation. Gao Fei who never expected that it would be real. An enraged voice shouted at the entrance of their village, calling for Gao Fei Bao. Still yelling, the two brothers were left speechless. Gao Fei who yelled back, asking them if they didn't want to live, as they dared to run wild in his village. Gao Fei Bao stopped his enraged brother, asking him to calm down, as it was difficult for them to go against the anger of the people. The people outside were still complaining and yelling towards them. When night fell, the Gao brothers were sitting and discussing how annoying those guys were. Gao Fei who complained to his brother about why the people were swearing at them and why it was their fault if they hadn't planted any peppers. Gao Fei Bao told him that he thought the whole thing wasn't reliable, so he told the people not to plant. However, at that time, they didn't listen to him either and following him was the right decision. Gao Fei Bao retorted that it should have been him who was the one to be scolded and wondered why he was dragged into the situation. A few days later, Cheng Dale and the merchant from King Zhu exchanged under the Toad Ridge. It resulted in a 10 to 1 exchange, where 1 pound of pepper was exchanged for 10 pounds of grain. 
and on that day, it was not known how many villages sent people to spy on the Toad Village. The spies reported seeing car after car loaded with grain going up the mountain to the Toad Village. There were even rumors that the stock of Toad Village was 500,000 pounds of grain at present. As time flew by, Su Ying wrote Cheng Dalei a letter telling him that the restaurant had become more regular with customers every day, and they were already planning to open more restaurant chains. Cheng Dalei thought that Su Ying's restaurant was developing so fast and wondered if it was due to the strength of a merchant's daughter. The system notified Cheng Dalei that the Rob the Village Lady mission was complete and that he was rewarded with one draw time, as insufficient conditions were unable to activate mission level 4 and asked him if he wanted to draw. Cheng Dalei told the system that he would draw. The system summoned the lottery machine and mumbled to be more conscious this time around. The machine congratulated Cheng Dalei on obtaining one secret book of swordsmanship. The Infinity Blade, the blade martial arts Lai Yao Chen once created for the Northwest Army's Great Blade Force, through which the Northwest Army became world famous in the Battle of Zai Feng Ku. At the front gate of Toad Village, people were gathering, telling the baffled Huang San Yuan that they were there to help them plant peppers. The people were desperately trying to win the good side of Toad Village. Huang San Yuan informed them that winter was coming and that they had to wait until next spring to plant. The people told Huang San Yuan not to forget them next year, and one of them stated that he would be the first in line and come to them as soon as spring starts. A dry leaf fell down where Cheng Dalei and Liu Jihan were seated. When Cheng Dalei was about to catch it, he exclaimed that winter was coming. Liu Jihan shivered in the cold. Cheng Dalei asked her if she was cold, to which she agreed. He told Liu Jihan that he had to write to Su Ying to help him buy a pile of winter clothing for Toad Village and asked Liu Jihan what color she liked. Liu Jihan answered that any color was fine for her. At the same time, in Du Mao's cell, Cheng Dalei asked Du Mao what was wrong and if he wasn't resting well, he would have someone send him a bed and quilt. Shivering, Du Mao questioned Cheng Dalei on how long he planned to torture him. Cheng Dalei responded that it wasn't their principle to torture prisoners. They treated them well, offering good wine, meat, and someone to chat with. Du Mao fell into despair as Liu Bei's face popped into his mind with what Cheng Dalei had said. Cheng Dalei thought that Liu Bei was able to even invite Zhu Liang in the past. Even if Du Mao had only one-tenth of the power, with time, Liu Bei would be able to move his heart. Liu Bei arrived and called Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei stood up and congratulated Liu Bei for his hard work. Du Mao noticed Liu Bei, which made his face pale. He was shocked and yelled at him never to come over. At the training ground, Cheng Dalei and Guan Yu sat together. Cheng Dalei questioned Guan Yu and his brother, who never practiced martial arts. Guan Yu explained their elder brother's belief that martial arts are one-on-one -on -one combat, and thus not worth learning, or they should learn how to fight against a whole legion. Cheng Dalei thought to himself, indicating that Guan Yu was bragging, as he was just at an ordinary level. Despite this, he suggested that Guan Yu consider learning some self-defense. Guan Yu hesitated, citing a lack of available teachers. Cheng Dalei handed a book to Guan Yu, suggesting he see if it suited him. Guan Yu opened the book and briefly glanced at its contents. Cheng Dalei asked if he could read it and offered assistance. Guan Yu expressed a partial understanding of the book, mentioning that it contained foot combat sword techniques but was not suitable for horse combat, which left him feeling disappointed. He closed the book with a slam and smirked, curiously asking Cheng Dalei about the source of the sword manual. Cheng Dalei cryptically responded, asking Guan Yu if he knew the origin of his own martial arts skills. Guan Yu replied that he had heard rumors of gods teaching Cheng Dalei in his dreams. Cheng Dalei proudly confirmed this, stating that the gods had bestowed upon him 8,864 ways of the sacred axe, making him unbeatable whether on horseback or on foot. He wore a satisfied expression while speaking. Guan Yu expressed his opinion, addressing Cheng Dalei and stating that although there are more powerful martial arts techniques available, the sword technique is fine to be passed down. He personally finds it too easy. Cheng Dalei remained silent, skeptical of Guan Yu's claim. In his thoughts, he couldn't comprehend how Guan Yu had effortlessly grasped the essence of swordsmanship just by a cursory look at the book. He knows Guan Yu is a genius, but he shouldn't be so freaky at the same time and also put himself down that he can't read, which makes him upset. This realization left him hollow. Cheng Dalei walks away while instructing Guan Yu to familiarize himself with it first, as he envisions Guan Yu eventually training other villagers and passing on the Infinity Blade skill to them. Guan Yu remarks that he no longer needs to familiarize himself with it, questioning if there is a more powerful sword technique that is more difficult. As Cheng Dalei walked away from the area, he couldn't understand why he had suddenly lost the desire to continue conversing with Guan Yu. After he made his way through Toad Village Gate, Sun Ju stopped him, expressing uncertainty about whether to share something or not. Cheng Dalei humbly suggested not saying it, but Sun Ju felt he should tell him anyway. As Sun Ju relayed the information, Cheng Dalei seriously listened to it. 
After a minute, he acknowledged the information and instructed Sun Ju to continue with his work. He smiled at Sun Ju, appreciating his openness. Before Sun Ju walked away, he reminded Cheng Dale to be cautious. As the midnight hour approached, Zai Yun walked toward Elder Liu Muyun's grave, overcome with grief. He mournfully addressed Elder Liu, expressing how the Liu family had lost their dignity and had even resorted to thievery, an act they seemed proud of. The anger and frustration on Zai Yun's face were evident as he spoke. He continued, mentioning that it wasn't just the Liu family, but even Liu Zhai who had become part of these evil thieves. In the quiet of the night, Zai Yun poured out his hatred, recounting the sufferings and injustices that had befallen their people, addressing them one by one to the grave of Elder Mu Yun. Zai Yun questioned how Cheng Dale had brought about the death of Elder Liu, expressing his disbelief. He then scoffed at the comfortable lives the perpetrators led, well-fed and well-clothed, with no worries about personal safety. He also stated how there were such stupid people. Zai Yun declared that their revenge and hatred no longer mattered, calling them a bunch of bastards. He bitterly claimed that everything should have been his if not for the misfortune that had befallen the Liu family. He envisioned a life where he would marry Liu Zhai, inherit his foster father's official position, and become the head of the Liu family. His face darkened with anger and determination fueled by his intense hatred. In a fit of rage, Zai Yun unleashed his swords, slashing uncontrollably at the grave of Elder Liu. He chanted, mine, in an outraged voice, his anger consuming him. The intensity of his fury led him to declare his intention to destroy the village. He muttered Liu Zhai's name, contemplating her face. As he continued slashing, his swords eventually broke, leaving him gasping for breath and momentarily ceasing his onslaught. In the midst of exhaustion, someone spoke disdainfully, commenting on the situation. A man expressed his amusement, clicking his tongue and remarking that it was a good show. Zai Yun, who had been deeply engrossed in his own rage and grief, was startled by the sudden voice. His expression shifted to one of fear and shock as he looked up at the man who had spoken. A group of mysterious men wearing hoods stood together. The hooded figure taunted Zai Yun with a mocking tone, questioning his ability to vent his anger only on lifeless beings that no longer breathe. After the mysterious man taunted him, Zai Yun's face became fierce as he looked at them. Intriguingly, one of them showed him an object, acknowledging Zai Yun's skill and added, if Zai Yun is desperate. He paused for a moment before continuing his words. The man tossed the object off the cliff to Zai Yun and continued speaking, informing Zai Yun that he could find the Northern Barbarian Division by heading far north, as he had a place for him. Expressing doubt, one of the mysterious men questioned the man, calling him the young prince. He voiced his concerns about helping Zai Yun, labeling him as a jinx and raising concerns about the potential for their trip to leak out. The man they referred to as the young prince reassured them that no matter how much Zai Yun struggled, it would be of little use to him. He then commanded them to proceed with their journey into town. Underneath the cliff, Zai Yun gazed upon the fallen object with a reluctant expression. Despite his shaking hands, he picked it up, reaffirming the location mentioned by the mysterious man, the Northern Barbarian Division. In a solemn moment, Zai Yun declared his intention to quit the clan while looking at a nearby grave tomb. Under the cover of midnight in the Toad Village, Zai Yun made his way to the storage room where the food stock was kept. He walked slowly inside and tried to set fire to it, driven by a sense of nervousness. Thoughts raced through his mind, urging him to burn it all completely. Trembling, he attempted to ignite the fire while grinning. A sudden voice interrupted him as Cheng Dale interjected, sarcastically asking Zai Yun if there was a shortage of fire. Zai Yun felt a sudden surge of fear as he quickly turned around and saw Cheng Dale and the villagers standing behind him. Cheng Dale taunted him, asking if Zai Yun wanted him to lend him a fire. Cheng Dale instructed Xiao Yu to protect Liu Zhai, while Guan Yu was tasked with taking some men to guard the gate, preventing Zai Yun from escaping. Amidst the tension, Liu Zhai anxiously called out Zai Yun's name. Zai Yun's frustration reached its peak as he caused a commotion, unsheathing his swords. With a swift jump, he lunged toward Cheng Dale and shouted Cheng Dale's name. But Cheng Dale unsheathed his swords and commented that the wages of sin are death before blocking Zai Yun's attack. Zai Yun was surprised and taken aback by Cheng Dale's improved skills. He couldn't help but reminisce about their previous encounter when he effortlessly kicked Cheng Dale away with one foot. Zai Yun questioned how Cheng Dale had improved so much in such a short time. Undeterred, Zai Yun continued his assault, launching a series of attacks against Cheng Dale. However, Cheng Dale skillfully parried each strike with his exceptional defense. In an unexpected turn of events, Cheng Dale slid back due to the force of Zai Yun's attack but quickly regained his footing. Kin Man sensed an opportunity and intervened in the fight. He suggested that Cheng Dale shouldn't have to do it and offered to kill Zai Yun himself. He then swung his spear towards Zai Yun. Unable to block or evade the strike, Zai Yun was sent flying, coughing up blood upon impact. While lying in a pile of sacks, he vowed that if he didn't die that day, 
he would seek revenge and kill them in the future. Zion's thoughts raced through his mind, he couldn't afford to die there, not now. With a surge of determination, he grabbed a sack of flour and threw it at Kin Man. Zion's internal echo stated that he couldn't die there. Momentarily blinding Kin Man, the other villagers coughed due to the flower. Taking advantage of the chaos, he dashed out of the storage room, leaving the villagers clamoring to stop him. Someone suggested taking out the torches, while another villager chased after Zion, their resentment towards him evident. Food meant everything to the folk, as many people were constantly on the move just for some food. But Meng Zion wanted to burn the granary today, which would drive everyone to their death. Between the flickering of the torches, even the Liu family hated him to the bone at that moment. In the prison of the Toad Village, Du Mao wondered about the commotion outside, questioning the noise filtering through the walls. At night, amidst the disarray of Toad Village, the search for Zion was underway. Alone, Zion carefully concealed himself in a secluded spot. He saw a guard looking for him. The guard spotted him and tried to defend himself while Zion was going to attack him. Suddenly, a scream elicited reached inside the Toad Village and through the ears of Kin Man and Cheng Dale. Upon hearing the sound, Kin Man's instincts kicked in. Calling Cheng Dale, he exclaimed urgently, pointing in the direction of the prison. Realization struck Cheng Dale, his expression morphing into one of surprise. The word prison echoed in his mind, filling him with a sense of dread. Cheng Dale acted swiftly, urgently calling out to the people. He urged them to move quickly and prevent Zion from releasing the monster. His plea echoed through the village, filled with a sense of urgency. Meanwhile, Zion picked up the keys that belonged to the guard. Purposefully, he began making his way towards the prison, his steps echoing. At the prison, Gu Mao's curiosity was piqued by Zion's presence. He asked what had brought him there and if his intention was to kill him, his voice laced with intrigue and skepticism. Zion's response proposed a deal to Gu Mao, stating that he would grant him freedom in exchange for saving his life in return. Beyond the confines of the prison, the villagers gathered, clutching torches that illuminated the darkness. Their gazes were fixed on the entrance, anticipation filling the air. The prison guard recounted his harrowing encounter, describing how he had been caught off guard by a swift strike from a large blade, rendering him unconscious on the floor. In his dazed state, he witnessed Sai Yun hastily enter the prison and lock the door behind him. Cheng Dale stood in silence, his thoughts churning. The prison guard then turned his attention to Cheng Dale, addressing him as the village master. He expressed his belief that martial arts should be virtuous and speak of respect, and not fight an internecine battle. Suddenly, the front locked door of the prison was kicked open by Gu Mao, Cheng Dale, Kin Man, and the village guards, causing surprise among everyone present. Gu Mao, full of determination, proclaimed his freedom after forcefully breaking down the door. He looked at Cheng Dale with a smirk on his face, declaring his intention to kill him. Cheng Dale reacted swiftly, ordering his comrades to spread out and urging them not to die in vain. Kin Man was recognized by Gu Mao, who effortlessly destroyed the prison door with a single hand. He declared that their previous fight didn't last long enough, so they would have another round this time. Gu Mao and Kin Man confronted each other face to face, with Kin Man responding to Gu Mao as he wished. Kin Man then swung his spear toward Gu Mao, who used the door as a shield to block the attack. Both Kin Man and Gu Mao slid back from the impact but Kin Man quickly launched another attack, which Gu Mao skillfully evaded. During their exchange of skillful attacks, Gu Mao leaped and aimed a strike at Kin Man, who expertly blocked and evaded it. Gu Mao appeared to be enjoying himself, wearing a smile as he gracefully dodged Kin Man's moves. In the midst of their fight, Cheng Dale issued a command to Kin Man, instructing him to retreat from the fight. At the same time, he ordered the archers to divide themselves into groups of ten, preparing for the attack. The groups of archers unleashed a volley of arrows, surrounding Gu Mao with a barrage of arrows. He used the door to protect himself. As Cheng Dale's voice echoed, he directed the archers, instructing the first team to stand by while signaling the second team to release their arrows. Despite being targeted by a barrage of arrows, Gu Mao managed to evade most of them but sustained a grazing hit on his cheek. He quickly instructed Zai Yun to follow him. As Gu Mao and Zai Yun fled, using the door as a makeshift shield, the villagers pursued them relentlessly, encouraging one another to corner Gu Mao and Zai Yun near the cliff, effectively cutting off their escape down the mountain. They also moved to block the outside entrance, attempting to cut off their path. Despite being struck in the leg by an arrow, Gu Mao persisted, carrying Zai Yun towards the cliff. Under the shimmering moonlight, Gu Mao and Zai Yun arrived at the edge of the cliff, only to find themselves cornered by Cheng Dale's group. Cheng Dale spoke first, addressing Chief Du and suggesting that there was no way out. He proposed that Chief Du should join his village, where they could enjoy feasting on meat and drinking large bowls of wine together, promising it would be enjoyable. Filled with anger, Gu Mao rejected the proposal, declaring that he wouldn't fall for such tricks. Even if he became a ghost, he would hunt Cheng Dale down. 
Cheng Dalei sighed and scratched his head, frustrated by the turn of events. He then commanded Liu Bei to assist in persuading Gu Mao, to which Liu Bei responded with a sigh. After the exchange of words, Cheng Dalei gives an order to Liu Bei, instructing him to convince Gu Mao. Liu Bei, wearing a bored expression, questions the worthiness of the task at hand. Gu Mao, upon seeing Liu Bei, is shocked and filled with terror. In his thoughts, Gu Mao wonders if Cheng Dalei's influence extends this far, expressing his frustration. With a bored look, Liu Bei menacingly tells Gu Mao to behave and suggests that he should return so they can have a discussion. Gu Mao's thoughts reveal his resistance and desire to never see Liu Bei again, leaving him flabbergasted and sweating profusely. Gu Mao tightly grasps Zai Yun, who, worn out from the pain, urges him as they were about to run away. Without hesitation, they both leap off the cliff, leaving Zai Yun stunned and filled with fear as Zai Yun's voices blend in with screams during the fall. A villager expresses his concern, warning that the cliff they were falling from was hundreds of meters high, fearing that the fall from such a high cliff would result in their bodies turning to mush. Liu Bei, puzzled by the situation, voices his confusion as he wonders internally about the sudden turn of events, realizing that he hasn't even had a chance to speak yet. While Chang Dalei states that falling off the cliff may not necessarily lead to death and could even trigger a rare event or something, Kin Man proposes sending a squad to go down and investigate. But Cheng Dalei dismisses the idea, deeming it unnecessary. He asserts that broken rebels shouldn't be pursued. He believes that if Gu Mao and Sai Yun survive, it must be fate, and they will take care of them should they meet again. Amidst the conversation, snow unexpectedly begins to fall from the sky at night. Cheng Dalei remarks that the first snowfall of the year has arrived earlier than usual. After the chaotic event that night, the villagers came together to support one another. Some struggled to pull themselves up from the snow, while others hurried to remove the snow. In the midst of their efforts, someone remarked on the collapse of the old house, confirming the concerns held by certain villagers regarding its structural stability. In some parts of Toad Village, Cheng Dalei and Liu Jai walk on the deck. Liu Jai remarks on the beauty of the snow this year. Cheng Dalei responds optimistically, stating that next year will be a good one. Suddenly, while Shenji pours tea into his cup, he questions Cheng Dalei's optimism, pointing out that there has been no rain for half a year, leading to potential crop failures and drought. He advises Cheng Dalei to refrain from talking if he doesn't have a clue, as it could lead to trouble if outsiders hear him. Cheng Dalei, seemingly unfazed, questions the lack of rain for most of the year and wonders if it's like this every year. Shenji continues, emphasizing the severity of the current year, highlighting the fact that there have been barely two days of rain during the rainy season. He believes that it's as if the gods are intentionally starving the people. He adds that now, just as the seeds have been sown in the field, a heavy snowfall has covered the land, causing the plants that have not yet emerged from the ground to freeze to death. Cheng Dalei sees an opportunity in the snow to travel to Black Rock City and gain fear points. He contemplates converting their carriage into a sled, reducing the load on the horse and increasing their speed. And he considers that if they were to encounter the grim people of Black Rock City, it would be easier for them to escape. Cheng Dalei instructs Liu Jai to fetch San Yuan, as they have a big announcement to make. Soon after, the group now begins their journey, and Cheng Dalei converses with the group as they embark on their adventure. He remarks about the poetic beauty of the road from King New Mountain to Black Rock City, which is flooded with night light in the snow field, and both poetry and emotions are boundless. The man passes through the roads in the village ahead, and the road seems as long as the night. Zhang Fei is taken aback by Cheng Dalei's poetic abilities, expressing surprise. Cheng Dalei, in a playful manner, admits to his skills and laughs about it. Cheng Dalei recounts his past studies in a sage book, reflecting on his desire to contribute to the country and its people. He expresses regret that circumstances have led him, a scholar, to become a mountain bandit. He ponders aloud if he and Zhang Fei are in the same boat. Zhang Fei's revelation about his literary interests left Cheng Dalei somewhat surprised. He couldn't help but think to himself how unexpected it was for someone like Zhang Fei, who didn't seem to get hung up on looks, to have a literary side. Despite Zhang Fei's vulgar exterior, Cheng Dalei found the situation somewhat comical, and couldn't hide his disbelief. Zhang Fei praised Cheng Dalei's poem, clearly flustered by its beauty. As the sun began to set, casting a warm glow over them, the system suddenly announced a mission involving robbing wealthy families. It informed them that the objective was to successfully complete two out of the ten planned robberies. The system expressed excitement and joy, addressing Cheng Dalei as a righteous figure and emphasizing the importance of his role as a mountain bandit. The system announced that there were wealthy and cruel families in the city and suggested taking the initiative to teach them a lesson. As Cheng Dalei was preoccupied with his mission book, he pondered the account of how he had gotten the upper hand over the Huang family, recalling how he had successfully captured Liu Jai and also apprehended Du Mao. He vividly remembered how cunningly he had tied up Du Mao and brought him to the mountain. 
With a sense of confidence, Cheng Dalei concluded that the task would not be difficult. However, an unsettling feeling of impending doom caused doubt to arise regarding whether the operation would go wrong and if everything would go according to plan. Seeking information, Cheng Dalei turned to Kin Man and asked about their proximity to Black Rock City. Kin Man informed him that they were an hour away and suggested a nearby Buddhist temple outside Black Rock City where they could stay later. Preparing for their arrival, Cheng Dalei suggested resting for a day when they arrived and then venturing in at dawn to get an overview. Upon arriving at the abandoned Buddhist temple, their plans were disrupted as Xiao Yu spotted a fire inside. He quickly informed Cheng Dalei that someone else had taken their place first. Curious about the current occupants of the deserted temple, Kin Man wondered what they were doing there in such weather. Cheng Dalei suggested to Kin Man that they should go inside first and investigate the people in the temple. Deciding to investigate further, Cheng Dalei and Kin Man approached the ruined Buddhist temple cautiously. Upon opening the door, Cheng Dalei discovered a burning campfire, causing him to tighten his grip on his weapon. Cheng Dalei's voice echoed within the temple as he mentioned that they were also staying there and asked about the destination of the people in the temple. He also requested them to reveal themselves and settle the matter peacefully. In a moment of silence, the person inside, who was hiding, recognized Cheng Dalei and called his name. Cheng Dalei's expression transformed into a poker face upon recognizing the person as Gao Fei Bao, the vice master of Flying Tiger. After a brief moment, Cheng Dalei praised Gao Fei Bao for his dedication and hard work despite the cold weather. Gao Fei Bao laughed and reciprocated the admiration, pointing out that Cheng Dalei shared the same commitment despite the cold weather by not enjoying the luxury in the village. Cheng Dalei smiled as he shared the purpose of training his men, emphasizing that his intention was not to get rich. He playfully asked Gao Fei Bao about his own intentions and humorously said that they might not have any food in their village as he giggled. Gao Fei Bao irritably dismissed the notion, claiming that Tiger Village had never been poor as they were too leisurely and only went out for activities. Suddenly, a member of Gao Fei Bao's group interrupted their conversation, informing him about someone outside. Gao Fei Bao's expression turned panicked and frustrated as he questioned why everyone was in such a hurry. He advised them to put out the fire. Cheng Dalei stopped Gao Fei Bao and peered outside. He advised Gao Fei Bao not to be hasty, suspecting that the newcomers might be their acquaintances. After that moment, Cheng Dalei welcomed White Wolf inside and stated that there were no outsiders present. The newcomer turned out to be White Wolf, who expressed surprise to Cheng Dalei and Gao Fei Bao at their dedication to work. Moving forward, as they cooked meat over the fire, Kin Man offered wine to Cheng Dalei to warm him up. Cheng Dalei suggested that their men should also have some wine to combat the cold. Gao Fei Bao, who seemed so curious about Cheng Dalei's meal, asked what he was eating. Cheng Dalei replied that he had baked bread and smoked bacon, stating that one had to suffer a bit while traveling. Cheng Dalei then turned his attention to White Wolf, asking her what she was eating. Gao Fei Bao silently stared at White Wolf, making her feel uncomfortable. As Gao Fei Bao cooked steamed soup in the fire camp, he poured the soup into a bowl. Cheng Dalei recognized the soup as sorghum flour paste. He expressed curiosity, commenting on whether Gao Fei Bao and his people only ate such food. He speculated that their diet aimed to be healthy and plant-based, supplemented with fiber. Gao Fei Bao forced a laugh in response, while the people behind him seemed offended. Cheng Dalei invited Gao Fei Bao to join them for food and drinks, surprising Gao Fei Bao and his followers. Gao Fei Bao declined, stating that they were all full, although his people couldn't help but drool over the food, indicating their true desire to accept the offer. Cheng Dalei remarked that there was no need to be polite since they were all friends, emphasizing that politeness would make them seem like strangers. Gao Fei Bao awkwardly mimicked Cheng Dalei's words, thinking to himself that if Cheng Dalei asked again, he would eagerly indulge in the food and drinks. Cheng Dalei then decided that they would eat everything themselves. Gao Fei Bao and his people were taken aback by Cheng Dalei's comment. One member of Gao Fei Bao's group remarked that Cheng Dalei had even invited them, but Gao Fei Bao had refused. Another member expressed disappointment at not having eaten meat for a few months. The people showed jealousy and sadness, and Gao Fei Bao wore a puzzled expression as he looked at their reactions. Gao Fei Bao tried to remedy the situation and told them that they just didn't bring good stuff. He then suggested they share the soybean cookies he had in his bag with their group. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei burped loudly. He then called Shenji, instructing him to feed the horses and thanking him for his effort, to which Shenji agreed. Seconds later, as Shenji looked through the sack of food, 
members of Gao Fei Bao's group engaged in conversation while checking one of the sacks. They expressed surprise at Bao's baking skills and asked if he could bake his own pastries. Bao quickly dismissed their comments, stating that his old mom had packed the pastries before they left. Meanwhile, another member eagerly requested to be given one of the pastries. Gao Fei Bao then turned to Shenji and asked what they fed to their horses. Shenji replied that they only had some dried cookies, lamenting that it wasn't the same as being at home and expressing sympathy for the animals. The shocked expressions on Gao Fei Bao's face and his people's disbelief were evident upon hearing that they were eating the same food as the horses. A moment of silence enveloped the atmosphere. The next day, the three groups sent their own people to the city to explore the situation. In a flash, Cheng Dalei, Xiao Bailang, and Gao Fei Bao, the three of them, were left behind in the temple. While Cheng Dalei focused on cooking meat over the campfire, Gao Fei Bao enjoyed the warmth emanating from the flames. It was then that White Wolf suggested an idea, she was playful and mischievous. She expressed her desire to play some games. Intrigued by the suggestion, Gao Fei Bao eagerly agreed. However, as Cheng Dalei chewed on bread, he questioned the amusement of the game and whether they even had enough money to bet. With a seductive smile, White Wolf leaned closer to Cheng Dalei, her voice laced with flirtatiousness. She suggested that since there was no money to pay for the loss, she could offer to pay with her life. Cheng Dalei, while chewing, looked up, his face turning slightly red, intrigued by her proposition. Cheng Dalei suggested playing a few rounds, his happiness evident in his response. He mentioned that if White Wolf won, he would also pay her with his own life. Gao Fei Bao, feeling slightly neglected, chimed in and reminded them not to pretend he didn't exist. Eventually, after Gao Fei Bao's protest, the three settled on using wine as their bet. Whichever one of them won would enjoy the drinks. As the play unfolded, it became apparent that White Wolf had become quite intoxicated, her drool evident on her mouth. Time passed, and Cheng Dalei shook the wine container, lost in thought. He wondered to himself if he had been losing every round and if the two, Gao Fei Bao and White Wolf, weren't working together to get themselves to drink. Just then, Shenji, a member of their group, interrupted, announcing their return. Cheng Dale warmly welcomed him and invited him to join them for a drink to warm up. Shenji proceeded to share the results of their exploration of the city, presenting a topographical map of Black Rock City. Impressed, Cheng Dale looked at the map and complimented Shenji's work, mentioning that he didn't know Shenji could draw. However, Shenji humbly replied that he didn't draw it. Curious, Cheng Dale turned his attention to Xiao Yu and asked if he drew it, remarking on Xiao Yu's hidden talents in both literature and martial arts, expressing his surprise. Xiao Yu humbly replied, stating that he found it more challenging to handle a pen than a gun, implying that he wasn't the one behind the map's creation. Cheng Dale pondered, trying to identify the map's creator, and then Zhang Fei stepped forward, revealing himself as the artist. He admitted that he was the one who had drawn the map. Zhang Fei shared a bit of his personal history, mentioning his late father's aspirations for him to participate in the imperial examinations in Beijing, during which the world became increasingly chaotic. He scratched his head, displaying a sense of contentment. Cheng Dalei gestured with a thumbs up, expressing his admiration for Zhang Fei. His thoughts drifted, realizing that the path ahead was almost set and the goals were also set. He simply awaited the right moment for momentum to build up as he smiled. A few more days passed, and the people sent by the Toad Village were often busy until late at night. Gao Fei Bao approached Cheng Dalei and asked him about their target and if he could provide a hint. Cheng Dalei, sensing Gao Fei Bao's curiosity, responded in a secretive manner, indicating that he should mind his own business and refrain from prying into their secrets. Suddenly, a member of Gao Fei Bao rushed in, urgently addressing Gao Fei Bao to look at the poster. The person then spread the paper to their hideout, and as Gao Fei Bao and White Wolf read its contents, shock spread across Gao Fei Bao's face. Cheng Dalei told Gao Fei Bao, emphasizing that his men hardly posted them overnight. He questioned why Gao Fei Bao brought them back. White Wolf interjected with concern, asking Cheng Dalei if he planned to rob the entire city. Cheng Dalei clarified that the situation wasn't as exaggerated as Gao Fei Bao thought. He explained that he was being cautious and his objective this time wasn't focused on money. Intrigued, Gao Fei Bao asked for clarification, wondering what Cheng Dalei was really aiming for. Cheng Dalei simply replied that he wanted fame. After that moment in Black Rock City, in a bustling restaurant, two men engaged in a conversation that seemed to carry a sense of intrigue as they read the poster. These two mysterious men were the barbarians previously encountered by Zai Yun. The man whom they called the young prince asked about the origin of the Toad King. The other man responded, sharing his findings and stating that the Toad King and his followers were mountain bandits from King New Mountain. He revealed their reputation for defeating a thousand elite soldiers from Black Rock City, causing Zhu Ban Chuan's forces to suffer defeat. The young prince calmly stated that the Black Rock City soldiers are considered elite soldiers, but he thought that those mountain bandits were interesting. 
he suggested that they should meet these mountain bandits if the opportunity arises. Amidst their conversation, Cheng Dale, who had been listening, interjected with a voice of skepticism. He addressed them as outsiders, urging them to refrain from speaking without knowing the facts and warned them not to speak nonsense when they knew nothing. The man was about to react in anger, but he was stopped by the intervention of the young prince. The young prince, with curiosity, wondered why Cheng Dale was speaking for the mountain bandits. Cheng Dale, with a hint of pride, responded that he had no intention of talking much but he couldn't simply ignore their slanders. He then explained that the Toad King was renowned for his kind-heartedness as well as his remarkable looks and elegance. Furthermore, it was widely recognized within a hundred-mile radius that the Toad King was called a hero, as the saying goes. The young prince expressed his confusion, stating that what he had heard differed from Cheng Dale's account. Cheng Dale responded, acknowledging that rumors are prevalent and it's natural for people to hear both false and true information. Intrigued, the young prince remarked on the genuineness of Cheng Dale's words and inquired whether he had personally met the Toad King. Cheng Dale responded with surprise to the young prince's statement and remarked that calling him a hero without having seen him in person may be in vain. Expressing his desire to meet the Toad King in the future, he then stood up from his seat and left a tip on the table. Cheng Dale responded that there might indeed be a chance. As the young prince and his man left the restaurant, Cheng Dale and Shenji remained behind. Shenji, filled with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion, pondered aloud about where the person came from. He wondered if those people had powerful backing. Cheng Dale's expression grew solemn as he suspected that the Ring Clan might be among those with high status. Outside the restaurant, Shenji couldn't contain his curiosity and asked Cheng Dale how he knew about them. Cheng Dale jokingly responded to Shenji's question, explaining that he possessed divine skills passed down to him by the gods, enabling him to tell certain things. He also made a request to Shenji, asking him to address him as young master while in the city. In the evening at Jia's residence in Black Rock City, a group of people gathered. One of them made a comment, remarking that on Jia's son's wedding day, even with just one or two pieces of silver, they could already immerse themselves in joy and witness a memorable ceremony. Shenji couldn't resist commenting about Jia's family having a big mouth. He questioned if there was once a famous official in their family. Liu Bai chimed in, acknowledging the truth in Shenji's statement. He noted that one member of the Jia family had indeed worked as a small official in the city. Liu Bai emphasized the current chaotic state of the world and highlighted that in the past, if the family displayed certain words on their door, it would have had the power to bring destruction upon the whole family. Cheng Dale, eager to join the event, suggested that they enter the venue. He expressed his belief that Kin Man was probably already inside. Shenji, aware of the bounty on Kin Man's head, voiced his concerns about the risk of him being recognized. Cheng Dale reassured him, stating that after being out of the spotlight for over half a year, there was no need for Kin Man to be afraid anymore. As they entered Jia's residence, the party was in full lantern lights. People were seated, and Cheng Dale's group found their table. Shenji ate a slice of meat, causing Cheng Dale to calmly scold him for his eating manners. He urged Shenji to calm down, reminding him that they had eaten similar meals countless times before. Cheng Dale expressed his embarrassment at how Shenji chewed, while also chewing food in his own mouth. Shenji retorted, dismissing Cheng Dale's comment. He pointed out that Cheng Dale's hands were just as quick as his own, and he questioned why he couldn't enjoy a hot meal for once, considering how many days he had eaten cold food. Liu Bai, observing their argument, intervened and jokingly claimed ownership of the leg of lamb. At another table, some men curiously asked about their names, sensing they were foreigners. Cheng Dale, with his mouth full of food and a piece of meat in his hand, responded in a disrespectful manner, asserting that it was none of their business. The group of men fell silent as they looked at Cheng Dale's eating manners. Suddenly, the room erupted with excitement as the bride and groom made their grand entrance. Escorted by their families, the couple approached the center of attention. The bride's face was veiled in a vibrant red fabric, adding to the air of mystery. Cheng Dale couldn't help but wonder aloud if the bride was beautiful or not, his eyes fixed on the couple. In an unexpected turn of events, a man suddenly screamed, interrupting the celebration. He yelled at them to slow down and declared that he wouldn't allow the bride to marry him. All eyes turned toward the man, startled by his outburst. The bride, with a mix of surprise and apprehension, uttered his name, Zai Kai. Someone in the crowd asked who he was, and a man recognized him dictating his name as Luo Zai Kai. He explained that he was a close friend of the groom and even held a marriage certificate with the bride. However, the Luo family went downhill, and the Jia family took advantage of the situation and forced the woman into this marriage. Another person chimed in, expressing disbelief, wondering if such a thing could actually happen. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale and his group listened attentively, absorbing the unfolding drama. Zai Kai, seizing the moment, stepped forward with determination. He mentioned that he had a marriage certificate, called the bride's name Zulan, and declared that she couldn't marry the groom. 
The wedding is about getting married according to all the traditional rules, and other lengthy rituals are indispensable. If the marriage certificate is correct, then the marriage won't be possible today. Jia Wu, the groom, seething with anger, commanded the housekeeper to remove Zai Kai from his sight. Zai Kai, facing the wrath of the crowd, struggled to break free from their clutches, enduring punches and kicks as he refused to give up. The people crowded around him, mentioning that they should get him out of there and pushing him away. Someone smashed his face to the ground, causing him to be battered and bruised. Zai Kai lay on the ground, but he gathered his strength to shout at Jia Wu, expressing his deep betrayal. He accused Jia Wu of being a deceitful scoundrel, pretending to be his friend while forcing Mrs. Lan into the marriage. Zai Kai lamented that he had treated someone as cruel and unscrupulous as Jia Wu like a friend. Inside her veil, Zhu Lan, the bride, uttered Zai Kai's name again and was taken aback and began to cry. Jia Wu, fueled by anger at Zhu Lan's tears, shouted at her, demanding to know why she was crying. Further infuriated, Jia Wu ordered his people to attack Zai Kai, urging them to beat him mercilessly and dispose of his body in the mass grave outside the city. The onlookers watched as Zai Kai was subjected to a barrage of punches and kicks, while someone snatched the marriage certificate from him. Zai Kai cursed as he struggled to crawl towards the person who had taken the certificate. Zai Kai realized the dire consequences. His thoughts raced as he recognized the hopelessness of his situation. He only thought about the marriage certificate but felt the weight of despair settling in. In a menacing tone, Jia Wu taunted Zai Kai, questioning his worthiness to compete with him. Wielding a wooden stick, he blamed Zai Kai for his inability to keep a woman by his side and challenged his audacity for causing trouble in their place. Jia Wu swung the stick forcefully, striking Zai Kai's head and sending him flying. Zai Kai landed on the ground, barely conscious, and caught a glimpse of Zhu Lan rushing towards him, screaming his name. He also caught a glimpse of the man's mentioning of burning the marriage certificate among the gathered people. Some murmured with disdain, while others agreed to the act, clutching the certificate in their hands. Zai Kai, observing his surroundings, caught glimpses of the faces present as he lay supine, his gaze shifting upwards. With a mixture of resignation and sorrow, he thought of Zhu Lan. Struggling to articulate his words, he sought her forgiveness, acknowledging his failure. In the midst of this dramatic moment, he saw a glimpse of Cheng Dalei waking him as he was about to close his eyes. On the other hand, Cheng Dalei noticed Zai Kai's fading consciousness and made attempts to rouse him, calling out to him repeatedly. Cheng Dalei examined the bruised and battered body of Zai Kai and posed a probing question to him, asking if he believed in justice. After Cheng Dalei questioned Zai Kai, who couldn't seem to answer, Cheng Dalei stood with a smile before forcefully knocking over the tables. He addressed the Jia family, stating that the Toad Village was conducting its business and they were only targeting the Jia family, advising the others to leave if they wished not to be involved. In the background, Liu Bai muttered that he was not full yet. Suddenly, the crowd exclaimed in fear, shouting about mountain bandits. Amidst the panic of the people, some scrambled to flee the place, while Jia Wu and his companions confronted the bandits. Jia Wu questioned them as to where they came from, wondering how these petty bandits dared to cause trouble for their family. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei, Shenji, and Liu Bai found themselves surrounded by Jia's people. Jia Wu commanded his followers to beat them, while Shenji expressed concern to Cheng Dalei about the larger number of people they faced. Cheng Dalei, with a loud voice, shouted Kin Man's name and ordered him to take down their people. At another table, Kin Man, Xiao Yu, and Zhang Fei heard Cheng Dalei's command. Kin Man responded with aggression, attacking the Jia people who were trying to stop them. Jia people were thrown aside by his onslaught. Jia Wu, commanding his people, urgently ordered them to stop Kin Man. As the Jia people contemplated how to subdue him, fear evident on their faces, Kin Man swiftly grabbed the head of one of Jia Wu's people. Kin Man intensely and rashly goes to Jia Wu, who points his weapon at Kin Man. In Jia Wu's thoughts, he acknowledged Kin Man's remarkable speed just before Kin Man forcefully slammed his head to the ground, making him unconscious. As someone intervenes and yelled stop, Old Man Ju showed up and called out Cheng Dale, addressing him as Master Cheng, seeking his attention. Old Man Ju, filled with desperation, pleaded with Cheng Dale, stating that they had no grudge against him and asking for mercy for his son's life. He promised to fulfill any of Cheng Dale's desires, assuring him that he would definitely be satisfied. In response, Cheng Dale questioned Old Man Ju's claim of no hatred, reminding him that he had asked for a share of their family's money, but he didn't do it. He then accused him of forcefully marrying a girl. Cheng Dale further questioned, mentioning that he was unable to let a woman stay with him due to his own inability. He asked if Old Man Ju would agree if someone tried to steal his daughter-in-law today. Terrified and helpless, Old Man Ju offered to give the girl to Cheng Dale if it pleased him but begged for his son's life. Cheng Dale clicked his tongue dismissively, contemplating the situation. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale realized the potential stress he would face if Su Ying were to discover that he had brought another woman back to the village. 
He also admitted his lack of interest in women who were already taken. Noting the apprehensive expression on the boy's face, Cheng Dale realized that soon he would be gone and the girl would become the object of trouble once again. Cheng Dale then unveiled the veil covering the woman's face and complimented her beauty. He concluded that her desirability was the reason two men had fought over her. He then decided to take both her and the young men with them. He remarked that the wind was tight and tugging, urging his group to follow him while emphasizing the urgency of their escape. As they fled from Zhu's residence, Kin Man carried Jia Wu and Zhu Lan on his shoulders. Cheng Dale warned his group that the troops would soon catch up to them and instructed them to use the secret passage they had used to enter the city, to which the group of Cheng Dale acknowledged his command. The Empire Guards pursued them, shouting for them not to escape. As the moon glimmered in their path, the group hurriedly fled outside the city, with Cheng Dale guiding them. When they reached the place where they had left the horses, Kin Man questioned the whereabouts of their horses. Cheng Dali revealed that the horses were located in the sparsely populated evergreen forest in front of them. He paused briefly, scanning the surroundings, and to his shock, his words stumbled as he anxiously questioned the whereabouts of the horses. Somewhere outside of Black Rock City, Cheng Dali expressed his frustration upon realizing that their horses were missing, and the sled had been pulled away. He angrily questioned who dared to rob him, vowing to spare no mercy if he discovered the culprit. In his irritation, he pounded his fist against the ground. Shenji suggested that perhaps someone passing by had taken the horses, but Cheng Dale promptly rejected the idea, stating that the place was well hidden. He sarcastically remarked that he had considered the possibility of theft when hiding the horse. Cheng Dale's face displayed a mix of frustration and concern, cursing under his breath as he sensed that he was being targeted for an attack. Amidst the darkness of the night, the Empire Guards were drawing near, as the night was filled with noise and commotion. Shenji inquired of Cheng Dale about their next course of action as their pursuers drew closer, noting that their conspicuousness with the two captives could pose a problem. Cheng Dale, despite his anger, made a strategic decision. He instructed Shenji to search for the White Wolf along with Kin Man and to take the captives to her place. He commanded everyone else to follow him into town, indicating his intent to proceed with their plan even in his enraged state. After some time, in a hidden house in Black Rock City, it was almost morning when Shenji returned from the city to report to Cheng Dale. Shenji praised Cheng Dale's plan, explaining that they had searched almost all the apartments outside the city throughout the night and found nothing. He noted that they would never have guessed their whereabouts as they were back in town. Cheng Dale, however, expressed frustration, mentioning that they were now trapped within the city. He sarcastically commented that the situation was great. Shenji then informed him that additional guards had been stationed both inside and outside the city, and several openings in the city walls were also guarded. Shenji asked Cheng Dale who he thought stole their horses. He speculated whether Gao Fei Bao might be responsible for the theft. Cheng Dale considered it a possibility and expressed his determination. He stated that whoever the culprit might be, he would make sure to catch and eliminate them. He bit his thumb in frustration. Liu Bai commented that getting so angry over a few horses was unnecessary. In a fit of rage, Cheng Dale frantically questioned the whereabouts of his axe, realizing that it had also been stolen. Meanwhile, approximately 30 miles away from the city, a group of men had gathered around a campfire. Among them, one individual commented on the audacity of the mountain bandits who had dared to enter the city with such a small number of members and cause a commotion. They chuckled, knowing that the bandits had not expected their horses to be taken. The man wondered how much the bandit would hate them, which prompted laughter from the group. As they continued drinking and eating, another man remarked on the strength of the wine they were consuming, which was much stronger than their horse milk wine. Some commented that one of the wine containers was empty, expressing frustration. The man shifted their conversation towards the stolen axe, addressing the young prince, expressing his interest in the axe, and sharing his intentions to use it in the future. However, another man playfully interjected, engaging in a friendly argument with the man whom he called Ida. He pointed out that he had actually set his sights on the axe first. Ida then challenged the man named Kaihu, to which Kaihu responded in a challenging manner, ready to engage in a fight. As the two fought for the axe, the other members only watched and cheered during the fight, showing great enthusiasm for violence. Just then, the young prince interjected amidst the fight, drawing everyone's attention. He questioned them if they wanted the axe, commenting on the weight of the axe and emphasizing its formidable size of over 100 pounds. Ida and Kaihu fell silent, and their confrontation momentarily paused. With a gleam in his eyes, the young prince continued, deciding that the two spears would now belong to Ida and Kai Hu, while he reserved the axe for himself, proclaiming it would be his weapon in the future. He then positioned himself in front of a tall tree, assuming a confident stance. With determination, he swung the axe forcefully, cleanly cutting the tree in half with its powerful blade slicing through the tree. The young prince clenched his teeth as he lifted the axe high above his head, admiring it. 
He then bestowed upon it a fitting name, Storm Tomahawk. A contented smile crept across his face, pleased with the name he had chosen. The young prince's name is Huerle, a prince of the northern barbarian tribe of the Ring. Despite his young age, he carried significant prestige within the tribe. The people of the tribe often praised him as a cold land wolf about to roar in all directions. Ida asked the young prince which name is Hule. Regarding their situation, to which Hule replied, not to rush. He described a world full of desirable things like flowers, wine, tea, weapons, silk, and delicate women that they could possess if they had the power to grab them. He pointed toward Black Rock City from the cliff where they stood. With fierce determination, Hule declared that the tribe's warriors were on their way and proposed that they first blend into the city. Once their people arrived, they would make a good raid on Black Rock City. In the chilling embrace of Black Rock City's night, Cheng Dale's group discussed the situation they were facing. One of them remarked about the cold weather, feeling the chill in the air. Shenji, expressing concern, questioned Cheng Dale about the current tense situation, seeking assurance that they would not encounter any danger on their journey. Cheng Dale was determined to carry out their mission despite the tense situation. Situation. He mentioned that there were many wrongdoers waiting for them to enforce justice on behalf of heaven. He specifically mentioned the Wang family and asked Shenji to share what he had heard about them. Shenji provided details about the Wang family, a 60-year-old man who had recently bought a 14-year-old girl, which enraged Cheng Dale. He declared that this single message alone is enough to quarter the man. Liu Bai and Xiao Yu expressed their support for taking action. Cheng Dale instructed Shenji and Zhang Fei to remain outside and wait for them. After the job is done, they plan to split up and move on to the next house. Shenji raised concerns about the heightened alertness of the city garrison after their robbery, and questioned whether they should continue to rob. Cheng Dale, however, believed that causing more chaos would work in their favor and used the chaos to escape the town. After that moment, the group then covered their faces with fabric masks and proceeded toward the Wang family residence. Kin Man positioned himself on the wall fence, keeping watch over the inside of the Wang family's property. Cheng Dale called upon Kin Man for assistance, to which Kin Man responded without speaking. As they got inside the Wang residence, the group hid, and Liu Bai asked Cheng Dale where they should go. Cheng Dale directed them to find the old man's room, expressing his disdain for their actions and stating that they deserve to be punished. They whispered their plans while staying hidden behind the house. Meanwhile, inside the Wang residence, a man and a woman whose name was Mrs. San were engaged in a flirtatious conversation while lying in bed together. The man offered Mrs. San some leftover wine, and she responded seductively by urging him to put out the lights to avoid being seen. The man, seemingly unconcerned about being caught, mentioned that the old man in the house was currently engaging in intimate activities with a young girl. He seemed unfazed by others witnessing their intimate activities, stating that he wouldn't be afraid of them. Mrs. Sin expressed her attraction to the man's masculine side, like a bandit, further fueling their flirtation. The man boasted about his bravery, claiming that he would even kill a few bandits given the chance. However, their intimate moment was abruptly interrupted when Cheng Dali's group broke into the room, shouting and startling the man and Mrs. Sin. Cheng Dali confronted the man and Mrs. Sam, commanding them to stay still. He declared their presence, referring to themselves as the Toad Village. The man and Mrs. Sam screamed in fear upon seeing Cheng Dali and his group. However, Cheng Dali's group momentarily paused and became visibly distracted by Mrs. Sam's physical attributes, their faces turning red with a mix of embarrassment and desire. Xiao Yu, still slightly flustered, managed to mumble his words in a question. He asked Cheng Dale if the girl present was the 14-year-old they were looking for. Cheng Dale, attempting to regain composure, cleared his throat and reminded everyone about maintaining decorum. He faked a cough to divert attention from the awkward moment. Recovering from the distraction, Cheng Dale approached the man and pointed his sword at him, demanding to know who they were. The man, pleading for his life, identified himself as Wang Papa, stating that Wang Yuan Wai was his father. Suspecting deception, Cheng Dale angrily accused the man of daring to take advantage of him, questioning why he had the same habit. He pressed the sword closer to Wang Papa's neck, displaying his disbelief. In a fearful tone, Wang Papa reaffirmed his identity and claimed to genuinely be Wang Papa, the son of Wang Yuan Wai. Cheng Dale then turned his attention to Mrs. San, questioning her Wang Papa's name is real and asking her who she was. Mrs. San revealed that she was Wang Yuan Wai's third wife, further complicating the situation and adding to Cheng Dale's confusion. He pondered the messiness of this large family. Cheng Dale's group gathered together for a brief discussion, leaving the two individuals behind. Xiao Yu, addressing Cheng Dale, acknowledged the mistake of breaking into the wrong room. He expressed uncertainty about their next course of action. Cheng Dale replied, determined to maintain control of the situation, and made a decisive command. He ordered his group to tie up the individuals who were not restrained. 
Holding their ropes and knives menacingly, they approached Wang Papa and Mrs. San. Xiao Yu, displaying a stern and unwavering demeanor, warned them to stand still and emphasized that his knife would not negotiate. Wang Papa, filled with fear and desperation, pleaded for his life, hoping to sway Cheng Dalei's group's decision. After that moment, the silence of the night was broken by the sudden chaos that erupted in the Wang residency as Cheng Dalei screamed that they were there. He accused the Wang family of committing numerous evil deeds, bullying and dominating the people, and expressed their belief that the Wang family deserved punishment. In a furious act, they set fire to the house before swiftly departing. Cheng Dalei rallied the group, urging them to leave. Inside the Wang family, panic ensued as one of their houses burned. A desperate voice cried out for help. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei's group fled from Wang's residence, while the Wang family members attempted to extinguish the flames. Some armed themselves, searching for the culprits, while others watched in shock and fear. The people noticed Wang Papa and Mrs. San unconscious and inside a bag. They exclaimed in surprise at the discovery of the young master and the third wife. Approaching the bag, they discovered drawings on the faces of the unconscious nobles. A piece of lumber behind them carried a message saying, Rob the rich to feed the poor, while another piece of lumber indicated, Enforce justice on behalf of heaven. Soon after, the Zhu, Lu, Chen, Zhang, and Wang families each faced attacks and fires in their residences, plunging the Black Rock City into widespread chaos. Someone remarked that Cheng Dalei had caused significant trouble among the seven wealthy families of Black Rock. Another person added that Cheng Dalei and their group always vanished after leaving a toad stain mark. A concerned individual interrupted, urging others to fetch water and stop talking. As Cheng Dalei and his group fled the area, Kin Man carried Shenji. Cheng Dalei carefully assessed the situation, taking into account the state of panic that had engulfed the city and the pursuit by the city guards. He concluded that it was time to escape. Meanwhile, the system beeped, indicating that Cheng Dalei's fear points had reached a staggering 41,135. The system recognized the completion of Cheng Dalei's task and offered a reward of one lottery draw. The system prompted Cheng Dalei, stating that the lottery would result in a top-grade weapon, general, secret book, or prop. It asked if Cheng Dalei wanted to draw now. Cheng Dalei declined, suggesting they discuss it after leaving town. After Cheng Dalei instigated a chaotic event in Black Rock City at night, he caused a lot of chaos in the city and wanted to take advantage of it to escape, but his plan failed. The six of them were big targets, no one could get past the guards without being noticed. They could already be tracked through their footprints. Instead of trying to escape, it seemed safer for them to remain within the city. As the crowd looked at the wanted images, including Hu Lei, he appeared delighted by the sight of their images and sported a smug expression. Somewhere in Black Rock City, as the sun was setting, Shenji, who had just returned to their hideout, informed Cheng Dalei that he had brought back food. Additionally, Shenji shared that while on the street, he had met an acquaintance who offered to hide them in his house for a few days. Cheng Dalei recognized the acquaintance and mentioned his name, Luo Zaikai. He asked Shenji if they could trust him. Shenji assured Cheng Dalei, explaining that aside from Zaikai, only an elderly mother resided in his home. Shenji expressed his confidence that Luo Zaikai would not betray them, especially considering that he seemed to be the one pursuing Zhu Lan. Zaikai approached Cheng Dalei and expressed that he had stood up for him the other day. He assured Cheng Dalei that he would never betray him, emphasizing that he was willing to guarantee it with his life. Considering the information and assurances, Cheng Dalei made a decision. He decided that they would temporarily hide in the Liuo family home and wait for things to cool down. Afterward, they planned to find a way to escape the town. After that happened, at night, inside the Liuo family's residence, Cheng Dalei slept and experienced a vivid and unsettling dream. Startled by the intense imagery, he abruptly woke up, his body drenched in sweat. He exclaimed that something was wrong. Sensing a disturbance, Kin Man hurried into Cheng Dalei's room and asked him what happened. Still feeling uncomfortable and out of breath, Cheng Dalei expressed uncertainty and responded to Kin Man that he wasn't sure while clutching his head. Kin Man pressed further, inquiring how Cheng Dalei knew that something was wrong. However, Cheng Dalei remained silent, lost in deep thought. In his thoughts, Cheng Dalei contemplated the overwhelming surge of fear points and concluded that it was definitely not good. Eventually, he spoke up, suggesting to Kin Man that he should rest while Cheng Dalei took over the night watch. After some time had passed, in the early morning at the Liuo family residence, Zai Kai, filled with anger and determination, screamed at the rooms where Cheng Dalei was staying, threatening to fight him to the end. Cheng Dalei, puzzled by Zai Kai's behavior, questioned what he was doing. Kin Man, unsure of the situation, wondered if Zai Kai had been acting this way since he went out earlier that morning. Continuing his outburst, Zaikai accused Cheng Dalei and his group of being unscrupulous mountain bandits, vowing to report them to the guards and take them to court. 
Cheng Dalei, yawning, instructed Kin Man to restrain Zai Kai. Kin Man clenched his fist before delivering a blow to Zai Kai, causing him to scream in pain. After a moment, they tied Zai Kai up and made him kneel before them. In an attempt to understand the situation, Cheng Dalei calmly addressed Zai Kai, urging him to speak slowly and without rushing. Zai Kai expressed his outrage, stating that if he is afraid of death, then he'll study the books of the sages in vain. He then accused Cheng Dalei of being responsible for the destruction of the entire Jia family and questioned whether Cheng Dalei truly cared about his own life. Cheng Dalei casually remarked on Zai Kai's scholarly nature before reacting to the news about the Jia family. He questioned whether he heard correctly, asking if the Jia family had indeed been wiped out. Zai Kai conveyed his dismay, emphasizing that Cheng Dalei seemed unaware of the gravity of his actions. He then passionately explained that the previous night, the entire Liu family, consisting of 37 people, had been killed, regardless of whether they were old or weak, with no survivors and corpses all over the ground. He mentioned the presence of a toad painted on the wall in blood, implying that they were scared to take responsibility for what they had done. Shenji interrupted and called out to Cheng Dalei, but overwhelmed with emotion, Zai Kai continued speaking. Zai Kai mentioned his fiancée, expressing concern that she had been caught by Cheng Dalei and that he had had no news about her since then. He feared that she might have met the same fate as others and been killed by Cheng Dalei as well. Cheng Dalei questioned the meaning behind Zai Kai's statement, asserting that she was clearly the daughter-in-law of the Jia family. He pointed out that they hadn't gone out all night yesterday. He irritably smiled at Zai Kai, expressing his surprise that Zai Kai hadn't noticed at all. Seeking clarification, Kin Man asked if they were being impersonated, which startled and frightened Zai Kai. He began questioning them, reminding them of their supposed blessings from the gods. He dumbly asked if Cheng Dalei could use the five thunder spells if he possessed psychic abilities and if they had the magic of the gods. In a fit of anger and embarrassment, Cheng Dalei responded that Zai Kai shouldn't talk nonsense. He quickly turned his back on Zai Kai and faced Kin Man and Shenji. Shenji expressed annoyance towards Zai Kai, while Cheng Dalei instructed Shenji to ignore Zai Kai and suggested entering the house to discuss the situation further. After several hours had passed, Cheng Dalei's group gathered for a meeting to discuss the situation at hand. Cheng Dalei, adopting a serious expression, summarized their discussions and stated his thoughts. Xiao Yu questioned who might be impersonating them and asked who they thought it could be. Kin Man stated that it might be Gao Fei Bao who was a possible suspect. However, Shenji dismissed this possibility, explaining that mountain bandits typically rob to earn their living and avoid unnecessary killings of people, and they would never do anything that would break people's spirits. Kin Man wondered who else it could be. Jiang Fei intervened and suggested the existence of a third force in town that they didn't know about. Liu Bei agreed, pointing out that a whole family had been destroyed overnight without any signs or noise. He emphasized that the unknown group seemed to possess a more professional technique than theirs, indicating that those certain groups were likely savage people. Cheng Dalei remained determined, stating that no matter who they were, if they were unable to escape the city, the other group definitely couldn't get out of the city either. He declared that those who dared to use his name for evil purposes should be prepared to pay the price and expressed his intent to find and kill them. In a certain location within Black Rock City, rumors were spreading like wildfire about Cheng Dalei. Someone said that they had heard that Cheng Dalei was terrifying, and rumored to have committed countless crimes. It was said that he had slaughtered his mother when he was only eight years old and his father at the age of nine. They also mentioned that Cheng Dalei ate human flesh, and it was rumored that he indulged in consuming three pounds of flesh and three pounds of blood at every meal. Inside a nearby restaurant, two people were still gossiping about Cheng Dalei. One person stated that Cheng Dalei is the kind of person who comes every thousand years as a great evil, and the future will apparently be very cruel. However, at another table, Cheng Dalei disguised himself and observed the conversation unfolding before him. The individual expressed their belief that one day, someone would defeat Cheng Dalei, and he would be fed to the dogs, while Cheng Dalei would be killed by a blade with force, making the mountain bandits. He vowed to get drunk and swore that he would never return until he was dead. While Cheng Dalei at the other table was just listening to them silently, in the bustling streets of Black Rock City, a crowd of people stood, their attention captured by an unfolding spectacle. Among the onlookers were Shenji and Zhang Fei, caught up in the commotion. People pointed towards a building, sharing their observations. Someone said to look at the building and mentioned that the Missy from the Huang family had used her own money to pay the army, while others noticed the toad symbol marking their presence. Whispers circulated among the crowd, with some individuals mentioning that those residing in the building were marked by the toad symbol. Concerns arose that the Huang family might be the next target for extermination. People felt pity for them as they might feel scared and panicked. In the midst of the commotion, a woman from the Huang family let out a desperate cry, seeking a warrior who could cut off Cheng Dalei. She expressed her willingness to offer her own body as a reward. 
Meanwhile, a group of women from the Jade Spring House announced that whoever could take Cheng Dalei's life would be rewarded with a free ride. Shenji couldn't resist the temptation and mischievously suggested kidnapping Cheng Dalei to claim the rewards. Suddenly, a group of hooded figures stormed through the city gates, riding on horses. Panic erupted as someone screamed, stating that they should run, and great chaos ensued at the north city gate caused by the strangers who had broken through. The group of strangers, which was the barbarians, fearlessly fought their way through the gates, swiftly dispatching any guards in their path. Citizens in the city described the gruesome events, with someone stating that they instantly came over and killed people. They added that they cut the heads in half with just one axe stroke. However, an individual speculated that those were the mountain bandits from the Toad Village. They remarked on the bandits' reputation for toughness and noted that they wouldn't dare to mess with them. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei and Liu Bei hid behind a nearby wall. Cheng Dalei's anger grew, and he indicated that he had found the group that was using their name, and that those groups were responsible for the massacre of the Jia family. As Cheng Dalei looked at them, he irritably said that the man was holding his axe. At that moment, General Liu Hang and his soldiers were seen preparing to confront the group, receiving expressions of support from the citizens. One woman approached General Liu Hang, urging him to return triumphantly while she would wait for him. Meanwhile, another woman approached General Liu Hang and expressed her unwavering belief in his heroism, stating that she knew he could never be wrong. In a separate message, another woman conveyed her well wishes to Mr. Zhu, urging her to take care of their journey. The man riding on the donkey happily sent a message to a woman in the crowd, promising that when he returned from killing bandits, he would propose marriage to her. He blurted out his words with excitement. Another man expressed his determination, assuring Jiazhu that she need not worry. He confidently declared that today he would kill Cheng Dalei, emphasizing his words by making a hand gesture. While in hiding, Cheng Dalei couldn't help but express his disdain for the citizens who were riding donkeys, cows, and mules, questioning their intentions and wondering if they were going to war or what. A person in the crowd explained that the city's organized township warriors were all generous and righteous men. Another person added that their goal was to do justice and eliminate the threats. Amidst all the events, the system beep interrupted with an alert, informing Cheng Dalei that his fear points were approaching 1 million and congratulating him. She added that when the fear points reach 1 million, Cheng Dalei would be able to randomly redeem one item of top quality. Liu Bei noticed that people were leaving. He asked Cheng Dalei for guidance on their next course of action. Cheng Dalei made a decisive decision. He suggested heading to the Little White Wolf to borrow horses and retrieve his axe. Almost thousands of people from the city followed the group of barbarians, thinking that it was the Toad Village. Not far away, the barbarians stopped and waited for the soldiers and people who were chasing them. Their faces were ready to engage in violence and chaos. Kai Hu addressed Hu Lei, the young prince, and asked about the arrival of their people. Hu Lei responded, stating that according to the estimated time, their people should be arriving that day and suggested engaging in play with them outside the city. Hu Lei then raised his axe in excitement and suggested that they let the people get closer and show some of their power, to which Kai Hu raised his arrow weapon, confirming Hu Lei's plan. Kai Hu advanced forward and prepared to unleash his arrow towards the group of General Liu Heng. In his thoughts, he calculated the distance, counting 3 miles, 2 miles, 300 paces, and 200 paces. Then he released his arrow toward General Liu Heng's group. With a swift and precise shot, Kai Hu struck down one of the soldiers, causing terror and fear among the volunteer citizens. Taking advantage of the moment, Kai Hu and the other barbarians launched a barrage of arrow attacks, causing harm to the soldiers, most of whom were hit by the arrows. General Liu Hang, who had halted and contemplated in his mind, thought that Kai Hu was just a few hundred paces away. With a bow in his hand while on horseback, he could take a man's life with a single arrow. He couldn't help but compliment the riding skills of these individuals, acknowledging that they were truly terrifying. General Liu Hang then ordered his soldiers to get down and control their horses. Intrigued by the situation, General Liu Hang felt frustrated. He began to think that it didn't seem like the bandits were led by Cheng Dale, but rather resembled the notorious Ring clan. The barbarian group continued their assault, engaging in fierce combat with the soldiers and the pursuing crowd. Hu Lei urged the warriors of the northern barbarians to play against the soldiers. Confident and daring, Kai Hu expressed to Hu Lei that he should do it. He then called out the group of soldiers, encouraging those who didn't want to live to step forward to pick up their death. General Liu Heng, determined to face the threat, shouted, questioning who would step up to fight Kai Hu. One of the soldiers volunteered, assuring them that he would defeat Kai Hu and bring an end to his menace within three rounds. A soldier expressed anticipation, contemplating whether Master Zhang, the soldier who volunteered, could successfully defeat the villain and eliminate him for the sake of the people. Another soldier responded, affirming that today they would witness the true extent of Master Zhang's power. As Soldier Zhang charged toward Kai Hu, a fierce battle ensued. The two combat 
combatants clashed their spears, with Soldier Zhang managing to block every strike. However, Kai Hu's agility allowed him to avoid Soldier Zhang's attacks. In a moment of vulnerability, as Soldier Zhang turned his back, Kai Hu swiftly pierced him from behind, leaving the onlooking soldiers in shock and terror. Kai Hu proudly raised his spear, dripping with blood. He called out challengingly to anyone else who dared to face him. In the midst of the intense battle, the savage warrior fought three times in a row and won each fight before withdrawing. Hu Lei himself stepped up, and he was even more powerful, wielding an iron axe so strong that several men died in quick succession under his horse. General Lu Heng's gaze remained fixed on the weapon that had captured his attention. The axe, seemingly familiar, hinted at Cheng Dalei's ownership. However, the presence of an unfamiliar man holding it raised suspicions in the general's mind. He doubted that Cheng Dalei, the evil thief, had colluded with the barbarian clan. He questioned how Cheng Dalei's axe could be in the hands of others. General Liu Hang also thought that there were other tribes who called the person a young prince. He then mentioned that the young prince of the rings was also called the Cold Earth Wolf. Hu Lei, with a grin on his face, confirmed that it was indeed him. When it comes to horse fighting, the rings are unrivaled in horsemanship. Thirty years ago, the mighty barbarians came, they killed people like cutting grass and laid cities in ruins. A vast empire, with twenty cantons and one hundred eight cities, but no one could stop these barbarians. After this battle, the soldiers of the empire suffered from Ragnarphobia and shuddered at the world's clan of Ring. There is even a saying that if the rings number more than ten thousand, they cannot be beaten. Whatever the saying is, it's better to meet than to hear rumors. The young prince of the rings personally went to the battlefield and killed eleven people in a row. The generous and passionate soldiers were already trembling and quivering, and no one dared to step forward any further. General Liu Heng then called out, stating that he would fight Hu Lei. Hu Lei acknowledged the challenge and readied himself for combat. As the battle commenced, the two clashed in a series of fierce exchanges. Despite General Liu Heng's efforts to block Hu Lei's attacks, one forceful strike inflicted a wound on his hand and sent him flying from his horse. Pain and frustration filled General Liu Heng's thoughts, he cursed as he couldn't withstand even one round, and continued to indicate that the gang of villains was strong. Meanwhile, Hu Lei, displaying a menacing aura, raised his axe, preparing to deliver a fatal blow. General Liu Heng, with a mix of determination and fear on his face, thought that the axe would kill him for good. As General Liu Heng seemed to have no escape from his situation, suddenly a group led by Cheng Dalei appeared and rushed toward them. Just as General Liu Heng was about to be struck by the axe, it stopped in midair before his face. Hu Lei's thoughts were interrupted by the realization that someone in the area knew his name. Ida sarcastically commented on the approaching group led by Cheng Dalei, stating that they might want to offer their horses once again. Both Ida and Kai Hu chuckled at his sarcasm. Filled with determination and anger, Cheng Dalei screamed for Kin Man to kill Hu Lei. Kin Man approached, seemingly ready for the fight, and Hu Lei responded with a prepared statement. Hu Lei struck his axe effortlessly, destroying Kin Man's makeshift weapon with his own axe. Kin Man, who showed frustration, pondered in his thoughts, cursing the terrible quality of makeshift weapons. In the midst of the fight, General Liu Hang shouted to Kin Man, throwing his weapon for him to use. Kin Man, fueled by annoyance, retrieved the weapon thrown by General Liu Hang and prepared for another attack on Hu Lei. Confidently, Hu Lei announced that he would show him what he could do with his storm tomahawk, while Kin Man responded with a defiant yell. As they rushed toward each other, Hu Lei tried to get Kin Man's attention, while Kin Man responded that Hu Lei should go to hell. They engaged in an intense fight, exchanging blows with their weapons and their horses colliding into each other. The soldiers who watched the fight marveled at the terrifying power of Hu Lei's storm tomahawk. Cheng Dalei, who grew angrier after hearing their comments, exclaimed that the axe was his own. Observing from a distance, Xiao Yu commented on Hu Lei's riding skills, noting that he was a good rider. Cheng Dalei realized that in terms of strength, they were both equal, but in terms of riding skills, Kin Man was inferior to Hu Lei. He added that if the fight continued, Kin Man would not win. Cheng Dalei commanded Kin Man to retreat. Hu Lei chuckled at Kin Man's speed in running away. Hu Lei boasted with a smirk, sarcastically remarking that he had not yet been defeated since he acquired the axe. He stated this while bragging and smirking. Zhang Fei, angered by what Hu Lei said, retorted that Hu Lei should not be so arrogant. Zhang Fei proposed challenging Hu Lei to a competition, showcasing only his knife and preparing to attack him. But Cheng Dalei intervened and stopped him from moving, urging Zhang Fei to remain calm. He acknowledged Zhang Fei's potential to defeat Hu Lei in 10 years but emphasized that the current moment was not the time for it. Shenji looks up for guidance from Cheng Dalei on what to do next. After a moment of silence, Cheng Dalei confidently declared that he would personally fight Hu Lei. Outside of Black Rock City, Shenji urged Cheng Dalei to be cautious. Cheng Dalei, with an air of confidence, stated that he still had some unused trick up his sleeve. He slowly approached Hu Lei and threatened him, asking if he could endure it. In response to Cheng Dalei's claim, Hu Lei was doubtful and stopped his scamming. 
He arrogantly questioned Cheng Dalei's capabilities while maintaining a smile. This prompted anger in Cheng Dalei, who fiercely challenged Hu Lei and asked if he was able to withstand it. Taken aback by Cheng Dalei's intense demeanor, Hu Lei questioned Cheng Dalei about what he wanted to do. The horse's reaction was one of shock as well. Cheng Dalei, with a serious expression and unwavering determination, continued to press Hu Lei, repeating his question about whether he would be able to endure what was about to come. Growing increasingly enraged, Cheng Dalei screamed at Hu Lei, demanding to know what he was capable of. With a deliberate tone, Cheng Dalei revealed that he possessed only one trick, emphasizing the significance of this move. He called it draw as he attempted to activate his rewards in the system. In his thoughts during the fight, Cheng Dalei expressed his reliance on the system, hoping it would provide him with a top-level warrior to team up with Kin Man, ensuring Hu Lei's certain death. Meanwhile, in the system, it showed up with the machine pleading with the system for gentleness before forcefully smashing it. After the smash, the machine managed to get him the legendary martial arts book. The system congratulated Cheng Dalei for obtaining the legendary Book of Martial Arts, San Mao's spear from the famous General Zhang Yida. In reality, Cheng Dalei's face displayed a mix of disbelief, shock, and speechlessness, as his request had not been fulfilled as he had expected. An awkward silence hung in the air, causing the atmosphere to become tense. Hu Lei, looking confused, questioned Cheng Dalei's actions, while even Cheng Dalei's horse appeared shaken. Sweating and attempting to lighten the mood, Cheng Dalei smiled awkwardly and remained silent for a moment before he spoke. He claimed that he was trying to create a cheerful atmosphere again. He excused his actions, acknowledging how tense the situation had been just moments ago. Hu Lei, full of anger, retorted that he didn't believe Cheng Dalei for a second. Cheng Dalei, still feeling the awkwardness of the moment, commanded his group to run, while Hu Lei, outraged, shouted that he would kill them and began chasing after them. Kin Man asked Cheng Dalei, who volunteered to hold off Hu Lei, insisting that Cheng Dalei and others should go ahead. Cheng Dalei dismissed Kin Man's suggestion, declaring that their revenge would be sought on another day. Kai Hu, leading the barbarian group, ordered his warriors to follow the prince and mercilessly slaughter the people. As panic ensued, the volunteers hurriedly fled back to the cities. While running, the system fear points beeped from hundreds to thousands. As the people rushed back to their city, the barbarians caught up with them. They unleashed violence and mercilessly slaughtered those who got in their way, including innocent lives and horses. Once an entire army starts to break apart, everyone will be just a drop in the bucket. The army breaks apart like a collapsing mountain. A disintegrating army is worth less than a dog. In Cheng Dalei's thoughts, he acknowledged the ferocity of the rings. He gritted his teeth as he looked back, wondering why Hu Lei was relentlessly chasing him to death, to which Hu Lei just gave him a death stare. Cheng Dalei, while glancing at Hu Lei's expression, humorously commented on how Hu Lei looked as if he were about to eat someone. He wondered why Hu Lei harbored such intense hatred towards him and jokingly questioned if he had single-handedly wiped out Hu Lei's entire family. Cheng Dali's horse, sensing the tension, also cast a nervous glance behind them. The story delves into the barbarian clan known as the Rings. It explains that the Rings live in a remote place and are often referred to as barbarians, savages, rings, and so on. When there was no war on the imperial border, the garrison and the Rings insulted each other every day. The most important thing was that the Rings couldn't surpass them in their stupid sayings, so they usually caught the one who cursed the most and then beat them to death. Amidst the chase, Cheng Dalei, who is scared, yelled to his horse to run while he contemplated his own regrets and shortcomings. He lamented not having taken the time to improve his fighting skills back then, wishing he could have fought with Hu Lei for 300 rounds and that there would be no reason for him to be ashamed today. He acknowledged that his victory over Du Mao in the past was largely due to luck. In his thoughts, Cheng Dalei wished he could be stronger, repeatedly emphasizing the desire for increased strength. He expressed frustration at the current situation, feeling ashamed of being chased like a dog, panting and exhausted, with his tongue out. The humiliation weighed heavily on his mind. As the barbarians relentlessly chased other people, fear points continued to rise, indicating the escalating danger. The groups of barbarians relentlessly slew people on their way. Due to this, the fear points reached 831,553 points. Cheng Dalei clung to a glimmer of hope, believing there is still a chance for him to succeed. He longed for a top-grade warrior to join forces with Kin Man, envisioning how they could defeat Hu Lei on the spot. Cheng Dalei gazed back at Hu Lei with a fierce expression, causing Hu Lei to momentarily feel fear and speechlessness. Hu Lei questioned Cheng Dalei's audacity to display his intent to kill, but quickly dismissed it, and his anger reaffirmed his determination to kill Cheng Dalei. Hu Lei's thoughts told him to kill Cheng Dalei while chasing him. Kin Man offered to stop Hu Lei while telling Cheng Dalei to go first, but Hu Lei fiercely attacked him, shouting for him to get lost, as he was still lost in his thoughts, still thinking about the idea of killing Cheng Dalei. 
Kin Man valiantly defended himself from the strike and told Hu Lei to go to hell, but Kin Man's horse ultimately got knocked out by Hu Lei's strikes. Hu Lei decided not to kill Kin Man and continued his pursuit of Cheng Dalei, leaving Kin Man behind, commenting that he had gotten in his way. Cheng Dalei desperately pushed himself, determined to reach the one million fear points. He gritted his lips, causing blood to drip from his mouth, with a sense of urgency coursing through him. The chase continued, with Hu Lei growing increasingly enraged. Finally, as Hu Lei closed in on Cheng Dalei, his horse got hit and caused him to be thrown off. The blood splattered everywhere as the fear points climbed to reach the one million mark. In the midst of the intense pursuit, Cheng Dalei then managed to draw his request to the system. The system received his request, then read lines that stated that the heartbeats of the people of the world would bring the light of the stars, and countless emotions across the platform would collide to create a person who would shake the world. The hero from the story would be reborn and was about to cross time and space before the system continued her words. Cheng Dalei intervened, shocked as he was overwhelmed by the chaos. He urgently asked the system to skip the lines, fearing for his life. As the system congratulated him on obtaining the top military general, Cheng Dalei questioned the name mentioned, hilariously suggesting various names, mentioning the names of Long Kai, Gong Sun Long, Lai Yun Long, and lastly, he questionably thought that it could be Cheng Long and asked who Long was and who he was. Cheng Dalei got frustrated and accused the system of intentionally messing with him. With no knowledge of the character or how they would appear, Cheng Dalei realized he had no way out. Despite his doubts, he stood up from his fall, gritted his teeth, and prepared to face Hu Lei, wondering whether he was destined to die under his own axe. After all the requests Cheng Dalei had received, Cheng Dalei bravely stood up to the approaching horse of Hu Lei and waited for his attack. However, Cheng Dalei's thoughts raced as he made eye contact with his own horse, which was now ridden by Hu Lei, and begged for its assistance. Hoping for a timely intervention, Cheng Dalei reflected on the moments when he had treated his horse poorly, despite their few months of being together. In that critical moment, he pleaded silently, yearning for his horse to come to his rescue and save his life. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei's horse remembered their shared experiences, causing it to rear up and throw Hu Lei off its back. Surprised by the turn of events, Hu Lei looked on in disbelief as Cheng Dalei quickly reached the horses. In rage, Hu Lei demanded Yida's horse, but Cheng Dalei had already freed himself and was now on horseback, looking at his surroundings. As Cheng Dalei rushed to escape to the place, he saw a man on the bridge. The man then asked Cheng Dalei to address him as the brave man. Before Cheng Dalei passed him, the man quickly asked Cheng Dalei if he had ever seen a handsome gentleman with marvelous eyebrows and a graceful posture. Cheng Dalei got curious, so he stopped after he had passed the man and looked back. The man just gave Cheng Dalei an innocent smile. When he looked back at the man, the man casually talked to Hu Lei, addressing him as brave man as well, but Hu Lei arrogantly told the man to leave. Cheng Dalei, who had been standing behind the man, quickly rushed out to the place. However, the man was just silently looking at Hu Lei, who then passed him. Cheng Dalei returned after a turn just to playfully respond to the man, revealing himself to be the handsome gentleman with picturesque eyebrows and a graceful posture that the man had been looking for. The man looked at him directly and gave a mischievous smirk and a wink, which amused Cheng Dalei, who was trying not to show his annoyance and instead offered an encouraging look. Realizing that the man was not the one he had sought, Cheng Dalei awkwardly doubted and asked the man if he was not the handsome gentleman with picturesque eyebrows and a graceful posture, but the man just laughed without saying a word. Cheng Dalei jokingly suggested the name Zhao Yun, but the man shook his head, denying the name. Cheng Dalei asked for the man's identity, and he calmly replied that he had a mediocre name that Cheng Dalei probably had not heard of even if he had told him. The man introduced himself as Zhao Zilong from Cheng Mountain. Cheng Dalei reacted with surprise, commenting humorously on the mediocrity of the name. As Cheng Dalei processed the introduction, members of the Toad group approached to rescue him, reassuring him that they were there to save him. Meanwhile, Zilong observed the situation. Cheng Dalei asked if there was someone among his group that Zai Long knew, continuing their conversation while trying to evade Hu Lei, who was getting closer. Zai Long confirmed that he knew someone in the group. Hu Lei suddenly swung his axe at Cheng Dalei and yelled that he would kill him. Cheng Dalei struggled to evade the attack and tried to avoid being hit. But Zai Long skillfully managed to dodge the attack with a small movement. Cheng Dalei was surprised by Zai Long's swift movements, also the horse cried in fear after avoiding the attack. Hu Lei, who was enraged, irritably questioned where Zai Long came from, and he should get out of his way. He then swung his axe at Zai Long who just avoided it swiftly. After that Zai Long took off his covers revealing himself, he sarcastically indicated that Hu Lei was the one in his way. In anger at Zai Long's words, Hu Lei continued his assault. He rushed to attack Zai Long, again screaming as he attacked Zai Long telling him to go to hell, while Cheng Dalei called out to Zai Long, ordering him to kill Hu Lei. 
However, Xi Long remained silent, but Liu Bei chimed in, urging Xi Long to kill Hu Lei. Xi Long then reacted and revealed his spear, covered by a fabric, and confidently stated that he would cut off Hu Lei's head while displaying a smirk on his face. The system then displayed, introducing Zhao Xi Long as a new character, a Debian top grade warrior at the age of 15, known for his skill with the White Bird Pilgrim's spear. On the other hand, the rings had already routed Black Rock City's volunteer soldiers, scattering them in all directions. Kai Hu realized that Hu Lei had been surrounded by the mountain bandits, and he quickly instructed Ida to send some men to retrieve their troops. He then rallied the rest of the soldiers to go and support the prince. In the midst of the battle, on Hu Lei's side, chaos was raging. Sai Long, recognizing the weight and power of Hu Lei's axe, knew he couldn't fight him recklessly. While in a one-on-one -on -one battle with Hu Lei, Sai Long strategized in his thoughts, realizing that the only way to counter the relentless cavalry gallop of the rings was to make the best use of their advantages and bypass the disadvantages, and that way to knock Hu Lei off his horse before he could launch his attacks. A fire glowed in Sai Long's weapon, and with a swift and intense move, Sai Long leaped toward Hu Lei, engaging him in a fierce fight. In a display of skill and agility, Xi Long blocked Hu Lei's attacks and managed to strike him multiple times in rapid succession. Xi Long mockingly commented on Hu Lei's slashes entirely without any literary style. Hu Lei's face turned grim. Xi Long commented disdainfully on Hu Lei's type of attack, likening it to a beast. Xi Long unleashed a powerful attack known as the White Birth Pilgrim Spear Wind Gust, enveloping himself in a blazing inferno and emanating intense power. He remarked that despite Hu Lei's wild beast, they were nothing compared to a hunter. Xi Long considered Hu Lei's efforts to be a futile waste of power and added a smirk after he said it. Xi Long's movement was so fast that it surprised Hu Lei. Hu Lei thought that Xi Long was very fast. In a decisive moment, Xi Long swiftly approached Hu Lei and struck him. Hu Lei gritted his teeth as he tried to avoid the attack, but a hideous blow from Xi Long caused him to fall off his horse with blood splattered. By now, Hu Lei's group had arrived and saw what had happened and were shouting Hu Lei's name calling him the young prince. The barbarians rushed towards the battle, but Kin Man and the others blocked their way. Kin Man then commanded Xiao Yu that they would stop them. In their clash, Xi Long struck Hu Lei's shoulder, causing him to grit his teeth in pain and staggered from the impact. This was followed by a blast unleashed by Xi Long. Xi Long let out a sigh of relief, feeling triumphant, as he confidently declared that the person who had tried to block his way had been knocked aside. He expressed his intention to continue his search for a certain person. Cheng Dalei, who was standing behind him, reacted with disbelief, while even his horse seemed taken aback by Xi Long's words. Xi Long gazed at Cheng Dalei, displaying a hint of rudeness in him. He informed Cheng Dalei that he was not one of his underlings and that he had only intervened because of a request from Little Bai, who was Liu Bei. Cheng Dalei found himself lost in thought, realizing that top-grade characters like Xi Long wouldn't listen to one without reason, and added that it was probably the same as Kin Man. He suspected that there must be a hidden task that had to be completed. However, his musings were interrupted when Sai Long commented that Liu Bei and the others must be over there and wondered if they had gotten into a fight with a few people. Sai Long then abruptly turned his attention back to Cheng Dalei, rudely asking him to borrow his horse for a while. He added that the ring guy, referring to Hu Lei, had not yet been defeated and might seek revenge on Cheng Dalei. Xi Long warned Cheng Dalei that the rings were unrivaled in horse combat, suggesting Cheng Dalei not give Hu Lei the opportunity to mount his horse. Since Xi Long had wounded Hu Lei's right arm and intended to take away the horse, he advised Cheng Dalei to help himself. Meanwhile, the dust and smoke swarmed Hu Lei's surroundings. He struggled to get back up from the impact of Xi Long's attack. He showed an outraged expression as he gritted his teeth and blood stained his mouth as he tried to regain his footing amidst the intense battle. In the confrontation on the bridge, Cheng Dalei and Hu Lei stood ready to engage in combat. Meanwhile, Xi Long, who had ridden away with Cheng Dalei's horse, said something to Cheng Dalei, wishing him good luck. Cheng Dalei took a deep breath in the chilling air as he prepared to unleash his swords against Hu Lei's menacing axe, Hu Lei, who held his weapon firmly. Cheng Dalei swiftly lunged toward Hu Lei, launching an attack. In response, Hu Lei shouted a threat for Cheng Dalei to die. Hu Lei aimed to strike Cheng Dalei down with his axe. However, Cheng Dalei managed to narrowly evade being hit. After Hu Lei's attack was avoided, Hu Lei swiftly launched another attack, leaping towards him. Cheng Dalei repeatedly said to himself that he shouldn't retreat, and at that moment, he blocked Hu Lei's attack. As Cheng Dalei fought, his thoughts raced, determined not to display any signs of cowardice in the face and shouldn't show his back to the beast. The intensity of the fight grew as they exchanged attacks, with Cheng Dalei maintaining a relentless offense. The two of them continued to block and counter each other's attacks, with the intensity of their heated combat increasing. Hu Lei couldn't help but wonder why Cheng Dalei consistently wore that menacing look on his face. In response to his frustration, Hu Lei taunted Cheng Dalei, labeling him a dog bandit. 
Hu Lei then swung his axe, but Cheng Dalei swiftly ducked, avoiding the attack. In a moment of opportunity, Cheng Dalei landed a strike, causing Hu Lei to cry out in pain as his hands were cut by Cheng Dalei's swords. Bleeding profusely, Hu Lei fell onto the ground while Cheng Dalei pointed his sword at him. Hu Lei weakly called Cheng Dalei a bandit, struggling to sit up and gritting his teeth. Cheng Dalei firmly spoke up and questioned if he didn't know that stealing meant chopping off hands, and proceeded to insult Hu Lei, calling him a horse thief. In the distance, Hu Lei's barbarian groups witnessed everything, and one shouted Hu Lei's name. But before anyone could react, Xi Long charged on his horse, swiftly slicing through Kai Hu, to which Kai Hu puked some blood himself. Hu Lei, feeling helpless, cried out Kai Hu's name as he could do nothing but watch from a distance as Kai Hu was taken away. Seizing the opportunity, Hu Lei let out his frustration towards Cheng Dalei, and then threatened him to die as he was about to launch an attack. Cheng Dalei, unmoved, calmly struck a final blow, causing Hu Lei's blood to drip onto Cheng Dalei's sword, while Hu Lei unconsciously still called him a bandit. Standing over him, Cheng Dalei questioned Hu Lei if he believed in justice, and asked Hu Lei if he had never heard of a particular legend even though he had been in town for a long time. Hu Lei looked at Cheng Dalei with a frustrated expression, offering no response. Cheng Dalei continued to speak, emphasizing the importance of righteous people and the ultimate defeat of violent evil by even stronger acts of kindness. He expressed his belief that when the day of judgment arrived, the wicked would have nowhere to hide, and those who deserved to live would live, while there would be no place for evil to hide. Cheng Dalei questioned him back if he believed in justice, to which Hu Lei responded with a cough only. Cheng Dalei then told him to look at the sky, while pointing his sword to the sky. He asked him how high it was. He then proceeded to look to the earth while pointing his sword down, asking how white the snow on the earth was. He then concealed his sword in its sheath. Cheng Dalei directed his gaze towards the axe, while Hu Lei interjected, referring to it as his own axe and mentioning its name, the Storm Tomahawk. Cheng Dalei raised the axe high above, reminding Hu Lei that it had been his weapon, cursing him for claiming ownership. With anger in his eyes, Cheng Dalei swung the axe down upon Hu Lei, blood splattering in every direction even towards his face and clothes. Amidst the carnage, Cheng Dalei declared the sky's height, the whiteness of the snow, and the ownership of the axe as undeniable truths that should never be questioned. After a long day of fighting the barbarians, General Lu Hang surveyed the surroundings. He felt a sense of fear as he realized that Hu Lei, the young prince of the northern barbarians, had died there at the hands of a group of mountain bandits. General Lu Hang's gaze fell upon Cheng Dalei, whose body was covered in blood. They locked eyes, and General Lu Hang took a nervous gulp rising in his throat. Cheng Dalei addressed General Lu Hang, commanding him that the head of the horse thief, which was Hu Lei, would be given to him. Tin Man interjected, thanking him for the weapon and returning it to General Lu Hang as he threw the weapon to him. Cheng Dalei then announced to their group that they were ready to depart. As they traveled back home, Cheng Dalei suddenly realized that the military strategist was missing. Tin Man informed him that the strategist was hiding after providing the horses and was likely behind a tree stump in front of them, while General Lu Hang just watched them move on from a distance without intervening. After a couple of hours, they reached Chenji's location, where Cheng Dalei asked Xi Long if he had been searching for Liu Bei and his brothers. Xi Long confirmed, and Cheng Dalei further asked about how they had met in the first place. Xi Long responded that it was a long story, but according to Zhao Xi Long's own account, he explained that his surname was Zhao, and his first name was Xi Long and not Zhao Yun. He was born in Chang Mountain in Zhending country and had fled to Zhuo country because of the plague, and his parents had entrusted him to Zhang Fei's family before they died. Although he was ostracized by the locals in Zhuo country, he became close to Liu Guanjiang's three brothers because he grew up in the Zhang family, especially due to Liu Bei's admiration. Later, he was accepted as a student by a martial artist named Tong for five years. Five years later, he returned to Zhuo country after learning the art but learned that the three had joined a mountain bandit group after committing a murder. He then followed them until here. After Xi Long's narration, he expressed his intention stating that since Liu Bei had settled in the Toad village, he would be joining two and seeking advice from the others in the future. Cheng Dalei welcomed this with pleasure. Kin Man expressed gratitude to Xi Long for saving them, acknowledging that without his help, they could not have cleaned them up. Xi Long confidently stated that courage surpassed the fear of life and death. Xiao Yu praised Xi Long's skills, tapped his shoulder, and stated that he had not expected Xi Long to be such a good fighter at such a young age, and asked him how he had done it. Xi Long responded that if Xiao Yu's heart was not afraid, he could achieve almost anything. Zhang Fei admired Xi Long's bravery, remarking that he would dare to face even a thousand troops, that he dared to break through. Xi Long replied with confidence that the spear was like a thunderclap that shone through the liver and intestines. Cheng Dalei observed Xi Long, finding his words to be both strange and familiar at the same time. 
He blocked Xi Long's path momentarily, silently contemplating his thoughts. Xi Long apologized and mentioned that Cheng Dale had been in his way, causing Cheng Dale to change his expression and think that Xi Long thought highly of himself. Eventually, Cheng Dale shifted the topic and asked about Xiao Yu's weapon, but Xiao Yu dismissed it. Cheng Dale should not worry about it as it had been just an ordinary weapon, and he could just get a new one. Cheng Dale's mind wandered as he reflected on the events of the battle. He couldn't help but notice that the rings had only been dozens of riders, yet they had managed to instill fear in hundreds of people in the area. Cheng Dale contemplated the possibility of a larger invasion by the rings, similar to what had occurred 30 years ago. He questioned whether the Empire would be able to resist the ring's cavalry. Recalling his discussions with Xing Zai, Cheng Dale remembered the ongoing problem faced by the Wu soldiers for years. Some advocated the formation of infantry quadrangles and the use of heavily armored soldiers to repel the ring's cavalry attack. Others advocated defending the city, although the rings could gallop well, it had still not been easy to attack the city. There had also been those who suggested focusing more on improving cavalry skills, but the empire had lacked quality horses and skilled horsemen. In the end, Cheng Dale concluded that maybe there had been a better way, just like the battle that day, the rings had not been that invincible. After contemplating, Cheng Dale remembered something and presented it to Zhang Fei. Zhang Fei had been surprised and asked Cheng Dale where he had gotten it. Zhang Fei then recognized the book as a lost heritage of his family. Cheng Dale responded with a questioning tone, asking Zhang Fei if he had never heard of the gods who had bestowed their skills upon him. Meanwhile, outside in Black Rock City, the volunteered soldiers informed General Lu Hang that they had retrieved the last dead body of the barbarians. General Lu Hang ordered his troops to leave. However, their departure was interrupted by the approaching noise from behind. The sounds grew louder as Ida and the other barbarians launched an attack on their position. Panic and fear swept through the soldiers as they witnessed the arrival of the ringers. They screamed in terror as they mentioned the ringers. Some soldiers called for a retreat, but before they could escape, they found themselves surrounded by the barbarians. The barbarians slaughtered all the soldiers on their way, and despite their efforts, the soldiers from Black Rock City were overwhelmed. It was revealed that the grim outcome was that more than a hundred members of the rings brutally slaughtered the volunteers from Black Rock City and Hu Lei's body was recaptured. During the chaos, General Lu Hang managed to flee back to Black Rock City with only 30 riders. In the King Miu Mountain, White Wolf confronted Gao Fei Bao, questioning his intentions. Gao Fei Bao, not one to mince words, retorted by asking why White Wolf bothered asking when she already knew the answers. He declared to leave the stuff, and they would spare White Wolf's life. The two parties were engaged in a confrontation as Gao Fei Bao and his accomplices had successfully trapped the Apricot Blossoms bandit. Tempers flared as White Wolf started to wield her swords and criticized Gao Fei Bao for his lack of consideration despite being in the same line of business. Gao Fei Bao fired back a question on the morality of anyone involved in mountain banditry and expressed his reluctance. To make things worse, Gao Fei Bao asked if she was forcing him to kill someone that day, visibly irritated. White Wolf replied that he had done the worst already. Gao Fei Bao irritably indicated that White Wolf shouldn't accuse him of being cruel to her. The tension was momentarily interrupted when Cheng Dale interjected and questioned the ongoing commotion. Gao Fei Bao, frustrated by the interruption, irritably told them that Tiger Village was doing business there. Before he finished his words, his threats were stopped as he realized that it was Cheng Dale. Suddenly, Gao Fei Bao, shifting the topic, expressed his surprise at Cheng Dale's presence there. Cheng Dale, scratching his face nonchalantly, explained his need to return home. In an unexpected turn of events, White Wolf sought assistance from Cheng Dale, leaving Gao Fei Bao and his group bewildered by this sudden alliance. Cheng Dale, however, reminded Gao Fei Bao of the potential consequences and rule-breaking associated with a rushed decision, speaking it with a blank expression. Gao Fei Bao, feeling caught off guard, could only awkwardly stare at Cheng Dale. He then defiantly declared that there would be no more robbery. After a moment of silence, White Wolf expressed her gratitude to Cheng Dale for his intervention and promised to repay his kindness some other time. Cheng Dale stated to give her body, but before he finished, he then attempted to change the subject and asked how White Wolf ended up being robbed by Gao Fei Bao. White Wolf, with a coy expression, hesitated to continue her explanation. Gao Fei Bao, who was growing increasingly suspicious, angrily expressed his ignorance of how she managed to rob the son of the Jia family and acquire a significant sum of money. He showed his frustration and highlighted the daily struggle, talking about the time when they only ate vegetables within the city and struggled to find targets. 
He emphasized that they were constantly blocked and chased by soldiers. His frustration was evident as he clenched his teeth while speaking. Additionally, he mentioned that they could barely get out of the city. However, his irritation escalated when White Wolf started to boast, leading him to question Cheng Dale about the misfortune of robbery due to White Wolf. Meanwhile, back when they were in the Black Rock City, White Wolf cunningly used her mesmerizing charm to rob them. She asked Gao Fei Bao about the amount of money he had made, leading other members of the Apricot Blossom Bandit group to comment on the valuable items they could acquire. Returning to the present, Cheng Dale criticized White Wolf for making irresponsible and sarcastic remarks and noted that Gao Fei Bao was already unhappy. White Wolf responded by laughing uncontrollably, appearing somewhat bashful. Gao Fei Bao dismissed Cheng Dale's attempt to appear righteous. He accused him of pretending to be a good person. He then questioned Cheng Dale about their results this time. Cheng Dale confidently responded that they had made a full profit. Gao Fei Bao scoffed as he expressed skepticism and implied that Cheng Dale was exaggerating their success. Meanwhile, in the Toad Village, San Yuan stood in the watchtower as he observed the situation. When suddenly an arrow struck the tower, startling him. He then screamed out to the intruders. San Yuan, who was feeling irritated, addressed Gao and expressed his frustration at resorting to violence instead of having a discussion. Standing beside San Yuan was Guan Yu. Gao calmly replied, urging manager Huang to understand that they were all trying to make a living and requesting him to open the door, promising not to harm anyone. San Yuan proposed waiting for Cheng Dali to return before continuing the discussion. Gao, who was lost in his thoughts, dismissed the suggestion, knowing that if Cheng Dale were present, then he would not be able to take down the Toad Village. Meanwhile, all the villages from King New Mountain, including the Tiger Village, the Wild Boar Forest, the Bald Slope, the Dog Head Ridge, the Double Bear, and the Apricot Ridge, attempted to attack the Toad Village. San Yuan, realizing the gravity of the situation, became scared at the thought of all the mountain bandits converging on their village. Gao warned San Yuan that he only had 10 seconds to open the door and surrender, or they would engage in a fight against them. As Gao started to count down, San Yuan turned to Guan Yu and expressed his fear while seeking some advice. Guan Yu, seemingly unimpressed by the bandits, likened them to dogs and cats as he displayed his confidence in facing them. San Yuan mentioned to Guan Yu that Gao Fei who was the word king on his forehead who rode the black horse. Gao Yu responded, seeing Gao as a marker selling his head. Gao was just silently watching over them in the distance. San Yuan questioned and sensed the same familiar feeling while looking at Guan Yu while Gao continued to count down. He suspiciously asked Guan Yu about his skills and urged him to show them. He suggested that Guan Yu should reveal his true abilities rather than trying to maintain a professional facade while Gao's counting reached number 7. Amidst the chaos outside the Toad Village, Cheng Dale, Gao Fei Bao, and White Wolf were having a conversation. Cheng Dale could not resist criticizing White Wolf while highlighting the irony of a mountain bandit nearly falling victim to a robbery themselves. He sarcastically questioned the situation and wondered aloud if it was not humiliating for White Wolf to go to the Black City to steal, only to have their horse stolen in return. When Cheng Dale and his group arrived in front of their village, he witnessed the presence of bandits, questioning why they were there and what they were doing. Suddenly, the fear points abruptly increased to hundreds, Gao wondered why Cheng Dale came back at a particular time. Confused by the fear points he received and by the bandits' reactions, Cheng Dale wondered why they were scared when he had not done anything yet. San Yuan, who was at the watchtower, alerted Cheng Dale that the bandits' intention was to rob their village. As the bandits launched an attack, Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man and Sai Long to take action. They aimed their weapons at Gao Fei Bao and White Wolf. Sai Long then pointed his spear at Gao Fei Bao, who sternly instructed him to behave, while Kin Man did the same to White Wolf. White Wolf was startled by the sudden attack and started to call out Cheng Dale, emphasizing that they were all on the same side. Cheng Dale dismissed her remark, accusing Apricot Ridge of attempting to rob his village. He questioned Gao's motives, as they had always been on good terms. Gao pleaded with Cheng Dale not to blame him and reiterated that they had all been trying to make a living. However, Cheng Dale did not buy his explanation, asking if they had robbed his village simply for their own living. In a no-nonsense manner, Cheng Dale made it clear that his friend's life was in his hands. He demanded them to leave the village if they wanted him to live and suggested that he would pretend as if nothing had happened. If they chose to disagree, Cheng Dale threatened to stab their friend with a spear and tell him that they could fight along with it as well, asserting that he had no reason to fear them. At the outskirts of Toad Village, Gao's mind raced with worry as he wondered how his brother Gao Fei Bao had ended up in the hands of Cheng Dale. Kui Ran stated to Gao that no gentleman had a petty mind, and no true man was without venom. Things had reached a point where they could only be ruthless to their hearts. In response, Gao frustratedly rejected the idea of ruthless action, emphasizing that it had been his brother. While Gao Fei Bao, who had just heard what Kui Ran said, irritably cursed him and threatened Kui Ran to be punished when he got back. 
However, Kui Ran remained impassive, blankly looking at Gao Fei Bao. Sensing Gao's hesitation, Cheng Dale interjected and offered to help him out. Raising his finger, he made an announcement to everyone present, announcing that whoever could bring him Gao's head should come forward. Zhang Fei, filled with pride, boasted about his ability to take the head of a general from a massive army of 10,000 people as if he had reached into his own pocket. Growing irritated by Zhang Fei's arrogance, Cheng Dale attempted to calm him down. Meanwhile, Zai Long stepped forward. He stated that he would take Gao's head. With precise movements, he easily cleared his path as the bandits fled through the air. Before Gao could move, Zai Long had already cut him, using his formidable combat abilities. Kui Ran, witnessing Zai Long's skills, experienced astonishment, unable to comprehend the existence of such a skilled warrior in the world. Overwhelmed by fear for his brother's safety, Gao Fei Bao shouted to Gao as big bro. Gao, though injured, mustered the strength to assure Gao Fei Bao that he was okay. He expressed gratitude to Cheng Dale for sparing his life and urged him to proceed up the mountain. With the bandits now clearing the way, Cheng Dale began his journey up to the Toad Village. Gao called out to Cheng Dale, while Gao Fei Bao, wearing a sorrowful expression, called to his big bro. White Wolf pleaded with Cheng Dale, calling him a little boy, soft or softer. While Gao desperately pleaded for Cheng Dale to release Gao Fei Bao to go, Cheng Dale responded, assuring Gao that Gao Fei Bao would stay with him for a few days but promising to return him one day. Filled with anger, Gao directed his frustration towards Cheng Dale, casting accusatory glances at him. Cheng Dale calmly questioned Gao, suggesting that he could come to his mountain as a guest. Gao grew frustrated and expressed his stance. He mentioned that if Cheng Dale wanted to keep Gao Fei Bao, then he would let him stay in the Toad Village for a few days. But he warned Cheng Dale that if anything happened to Gao Fei Bao, he would not hesitate to fight it out. Cheng Dale glanced a look at Gao behind him. He stated that even though Gao would fight, it didn't guarantee that Gao would win. Inside the Toad Village, now enveloped in the night's darkness after the earlier events, Liu Jai approached Cheng Dale, suggesting he soak his feet in hot water before taking a bath, while Cheng Dale sat, engrossed in reading a large piece of paper. Cheng Dale muttered to himself, stating that the world isn't meaningless, his eyes fixed on the big paper. Curious, he turned to Liu Jai and asked why she believed that the bandits were ganging up on them, as he always thought that he was a good person. Liu Jai's retort implied that the reason for resorting to robbery was the lack of earning a living, she said while pressing the towel. Cheng Dale, upon reflecting on her remark, disappointedly questioned that they were robbed just because they couldn't earn a living. He emphasized the unfairness of their actions as a reason. Cheng Dale just sighed and gently dismissed Liu Jai, saying there was no need to serve him to that extent while patting her head. In a compassionate gesture, Cheng Dale instructed Liu Jai to bring another pot of hot water so that they could soak their feet together. He advised her to take a shower and rest early due to the cold weather outside, while he took the towel from her hand. Liu Jai obediently followed his instructions. A few minutes later, with Liu Jai's feet warmed in the hot water, she sat beside Cheng Dale Lei, her face displaying satisfaction. While her feet soaked in the hot water, Liu Jai shyly expressed her comfort. She stumbled upon her words while calling Cheng Dale that she felt a bit cold. In response, Cheng Dale suggested that she could lean over a bit, but before he could finish his sentence, Liu Jai promptly leaned over. Her face turned completely red, displaying her delighted face. In an area of King New Mountain, Cheng Dale followed Kin Man on his journey, and they both hiked up the mountain. Cheng Dale asked Kin Man about what he should do. Kin Man looked back at Cheng Dale and advised him to avoid causing any trouble. Cheng Dale fell silent. Kin Man continued, cautioning Cheng Dale to be careful and not disturb the bears in their den. He expressed that it was enough to catch some deer and rabbits. Cheng Dale asked if they were easy to catch, to which Kin Man responded that it was not easy at all. As they walked through the mountain, they stumbled upon a hole in the ground. Cheng Dale asked Kin Man to examine it closely, curious about the animal responsible for digging it. Kin Man calmly replied that it had been dug by a person. Cheng Dale expressed his surprise, questioning why someone would dig and asking if they were not afraid of freezing their hands. Kin Man explained that despite the appearance of snow covering the mountain, many plants continued to grow underneath the snow that could fill the stomach. He mentioned that he used to dig for food in the past but no longer needed to do so. Cheng Dale asked if they were searching for ginseng, to which Kin Man clarified they were looking for grassroots. As they continued their journey, Cheng Dale and Kin Man encountered a homeless kid and a mother. Cheng Dale questioned them, asking if they were the ones who dug the holes. He asked them where the village they came from. Moved by their situation, Kin Man offered the homeless individuals a loaf of bread. The kid eagerly received it and bit it, she then showed it to her mother, and they split the bread in half, embracing each other. Cheng Dale and Kin Man proceeded with their exploration, leaving behind their footprints in the area. Cheng Dale glanced back towards the homeless individuals, who expressed silent gratitude without uttering a word. The young child began to eat the bread. 
Cheng Dali's expression hardened, his determination growing stronger. After that moment, in the prison of Toad Village, White Wolf and Gao Feibao engaged in a lively game of dice. White Wolf eagerly called for bigger numbers, while Gao Feibao preferred smaller ones. With excitement, White Wolf celebrated her victory, she stated that she always chose the bigger numbers. Gao Feibao, with a smirk on his face, acknowledged the outcome. His gaze momentarily fixated on White Wolf's chest, while another person beside Gao Fei Bao stated that they needed to remain resilient. Undeterred, White Wolf demanded another round of the game. However, their game was interrupted when Cheng Dalei unexpectedly appeared in the prison, commenting on their lively game and expressing if he could join them. But he shifted the topic by announcing that he had good news for them. He decided to release some of them first and emphasized that the rest would remain locked up based on their behavior. He inquired which one of them wanted to be the first to leave. Gao Feibao and his people began discussing the situation. But Gao Feibao erupted in anger, stating that he should not pretend to be nice and that he wouldn't give in to him. He expressed his determination to stay, willing to face any consequences together. One of Gao Feibao's men commented on his speed in expressing their sentiment, feeling that they would have said the same. Another man criticized the unfairness of Gao Feibao's actions. Cheng Dalei contemplated the sudden change in Gao Feibao's attitude, his face reflecting confusion. Cheng Dalei insisted that he had to go that day, urging them to discuss among themselves who would leave. Gao Feibao jokingly wrapped his arms around Lai and threatened him. But Lai was visibly frightened, citing his 80-year-old mother and his 8-year-old child. He begged that he be allowed to stay for two more days. Another man reassured Lai that in the future he would honor his mother, raise his child, and take care of his wife. However, his words were abruptly cut off. White Wolf silently looked at them from her cell, contemplating whether she should also make a decision. Suddenly, the prison door opened, and Liu Bei entered with a food cart, announcing that dinner was ready. Cheng Dalei commented on the coldness, and one of the prisoners requested the door to be closed. Liu Bei warned them that they wouldn't receive food if they continued to talk. They held conflicting thoughts about leaving the place, as they would not go out, not in that life while looking at the magnificent food prepared for them. Some were firm about staying, thinking that they hadn't harvested in agriculture, and that prison was their only chance for a relatively normal life. On the other hand, Gao Feibao expressed a different perspective. He felt that being in prison felt like being at home and that the feeling inside the prison was even better than what he felt at home. Also, he admired the talented and pleasant conversations of people there, and he particularly enjoyed the delicious food provided by the prison. White Wolf, in particular, had a happy expression on her face as she savored the thought of the tasty meals. Cheng Dalei and Liu Bei left the prison, and Cheng Dalei asked Liu Bei about the group of people they couldn't drive away. He wondered if they could receive psychological care. Liu Bei remained silent for a moment before inviting Cheng Dalei to follow him. They arrived at the highest point of the Toad Mountain Range, known as Toad's Mouth, located at the back of Toad Village, from where they could see King New Mountain in full size. Liu Bei invited Cheng Dalei to see the view. He remarked that the mountain was like ice, the forests were like snow, the magic of the sky and the earth, nothing more than this, and expressed his appreciation for the majestic sight that was not perceived by ordinary mortals. Cheng Dalei acknowledged Liu Bei's appreciation of the mountains and river, to which Liu Bei asked what he meant. Liu Bei then revealed that he just wanted to show Cheng Dalei that only the Toad Village in King New Mountain had smoke from kitchen chimneys. Cheng Dalei responded, they were, to which Liu Bei confirmed with a sigh, out of food. Cheng Dalei questioned the severity of the situation, wondering if it couldn't be that serious. Liu Bei's response left no room for doubt, it was indeed that serious. Upon hearing from Xi Long, they discovered the devastating reality of a thousand-mile drought in Yuzhu. It was revealed that the agricultural situation was grim, with a mere eight buckets of harvest in autumn despite sowing 60 kilos of seeds during spring. Due to the severe drought in Yuzhu, landlords mercilessly evicted tenants who couldn't meet the harvest requirements. Desperate measures were taken, including sacrificing boys and girls in hopes of bringing rain. However, just as winter arrived, a heavy snowfall occurred, freezing the plant seeds in the ground instantly. The northern barbarian grasslands were sandy and cattle and sheep were starving to death, which is why Hulei brought people to Black Rock City to fight for land. Additionally, the people didn't have enough food to eat, and the wilderness was full of dead bodies of the starved. People ate from their children and cooked from their bones. Liu Bei observed the dire situation on King Miu Mountain, noting the scarcity of food. He expressed concern that if the situation persisted, desperate people would likely risk coming to them. He foresaw a gathering of 5,000 hungry men who might have posed a threat to Toad Village, and that the Toad Village might not have been able to hold them back. Liu Bei advised Cheng Dali to start planning early. Liu Bei saw the dire situation as a potential opportunity. He suggested that in the face of human lives being undervalued, they could seize this moment to recruit troops, acquire horses, and sweep the other mountain villages of King New Mountain. 
By doing so, they could strengthen and unite the King New Mountain. However, Cheng Dalei fell into silence, his gaze fixed on the cliff. Just a couple of seconds passed, and Cheng Dalei noticed a man down below and questioned Liu Bei about what the guy was doing down there. Liu Bei calmly responded that the guy was burying the dead. Cheng Dalei wondered why the guy had to do it secretly. Liu Bei responded, suggesting that if the burial were not done secretly, someone might have dug up the bodies and eaten them. He smirked mischievously and glanced at Cheng Dalei. After hearing it, Cheng Dalei felt nauseous, almost leading him to vomit. Liu Bei continued, expressing concern that if the situation persisted, more people would die. He mentioned that if Cheng Dalei could not stand it, he proposed the possibility of distributing their village's food, but expressed concerns about their village's survival during winter. He then posed a question to Cheng Dalei, asking him to choose between the two options, while glancing at Cheng Dalei, waiting for his response. Cheng Dalei responded, stating that the second option didn't seem beneficial to him. Liu Bei argued that there could still be some benefits, such as winning people's hearts or finding inner peace in his own heart. Cheng Dalei fell silent and grew serious in contemplation. Suddenly, the system emerged and announced a new mission to Cheng Dalei. The system cheerfully addressed him as a brave boy and presented two tasks. The first task was to recruit troops and begin the path to world domination by sweeping King New Mountain. The second task was to help the people around him as a righteous boy, do what he could to help them through a difficult time. In the tranquil afternoon of Toad Village, Cheng Dalei and Liu Zhai sat together. Liu Zhai observed Cheng Dalei with concern, noting his lack of appetite. Cheng Dalei responded that he didn't have an appetite. Suddenly, he mentioned his plans for a trip to Fallen Leaf City, instructing Liu Zhai to prepare his horse. Surprised by the sudden decision, Liu Zhai asked if Cheng Dalei didn't want to rest for a few days after he got back. Cheng Dalei replied that he had something important to do and he would be back that night. But Liu Zhai pondered the significance of his mission, her discontent evident in her pouting expression. She called Cheng Dalei and hurriedly handed him a handkerchief, stating that she had embroidered it herself. Once she handed him the handkerchief, she urged Cheng Dalei to come back soon. After Cheng Dalei accepted the handkerchief without a word, he continued on his way. As the sun dipped below, he journeyed through the path that led to Fallen Leaf City. Hours later, he arrived at the renowned restaurant owned by Su Ying. Just then, Sun Ju approached him with a warm smile, addressing him as the village master. Curious about Su Ying's whereabouts, Cheng Dalei inquired, prompting Sun Ju to reveal that she was in the lobby. Sun Ju added that there were some people looking for her. Intrigued, Cheng Dalei asked Sun Ju about the type of people they were. Sun Ju responded that they were someone from the Su family. Inside the restaurant, a man named Su Milan, Su Ying's eldest uncle, confronted Su Ying about exposing her indecent behavior in public. He added that the face of Su's family was dishonored by her. Su Ying defiantly stated that she had been kicked out of the Su family and was no longer its member, crossing her arms in solidarity with Xiao Yi, who stood beside her. Malin asserted that the restaurant originally belonged to the Su family and demanded that Su Ying return it since she no longer considered herself a part of the family. Xiao Yi angrily retorted, accusing Malin of being unreasonable, that he had left the restaurant to Su Ying, and now he wanted to reclaim it only after seeing the restaurant doing well. Another man interjected, belittling Xiao Yi, stating that she had no right to speak and insinuating that her attitude mirrored her master's. Malin then stated that if either Su Ying returned to the restaurant and her life and death had nothing more to do with the Su family, or she went home with him and no longer disgraced the Su family. Just as tensions escalated, Cheng Dalei intervened, speaking up and asking what was going on there. Malin responded disdainfully, questioning the person's identity and mocking the lack of decency among those present. Cheng Dalei remained determined, demanding to know what was wrong. All eyes turned to Cheng Dalei, including Su Ying. Another person who was present, caught off guard by Cheng Dalei's presence, could not finish his thought and wore a worried expression, while Malin still asked who Cheng Dalei was. Cheng Dalei, with a serious demeanor, challenged the troublemakers, asserting his authority on his own turf and ordered them to leave, while glaring at them intensely. Recognizing Cheng Dalei's identity, one of the men expressed fear, realizing that they were dealing with Cheng Dalei himself. Malin, filled with frustration, directed his anger toward Cheng Dalei, grinding his teeth in irritation. Suddenly, members of the Su family hurriedly exited the restaurant, urging Malin to leave swiftly. One of them warned Malin about the danger of tangling with Cheng Dalei. As the Su family exited behind Cheng Dalei, Cheng Dalei expressed cheerfulness to Su Ying, remarking that it had been a long time since they last met. Su Ying, upon seeing Cheng Dalei, blushed, feeling a mix of curiosity and intrigue. In a surprising move, Su Ying snatched the embroidery handkerchief from Cheng Dalei's shirt. Shocked, Cheng Dalei stumbled in his response, stating that he had intended to give it to her, but she had found it instead, complimenting her intelligence. Su Ying remained silent, her gaze fixed on the handkerchief. Zhao Yi, displaying her irritation, referred to Cheng Dalei as a playboy. 
Cheng Dale, pretending innocence, chose to remain silent, leaving the atmosphere charged with unspoken tension. After a minute of silence, Su Yin, with Zhao Yi still resting on her shoulder, inquired about Cheng Dale's purpose for being there. Cheng Dale replied that he had come to buy grain from her. Su Ying expressed surprise, questioning why he would concern himself with such minor matters. Cheng Dale explained that witnessing people die every day in front of his eyes, he stated that it didn't matter much if Su Ying didn't see it but he couldn't pretend that he didn't see it. Su Ying responded, letting him know that Fallen Leaf City didn't have the grain he wanted. Cheng Dali interrupted, seeking clarification about the absence of grains. Nevertheless, Su Ying continued speaking while pouring water into a teacup, mentioning that the whole Yuzhu province was experiencing no food and that food prices were skyrocketing. Even though Cheng Dali was rich, he couldn't afford it. Cheng Dale casually suggested robbing the grain, while Su Ying dismissed the idea, questioning the feasibility of stealing one or two hundred thousand pounds of grain. Cheng Dale acknowledged that it was unrealistic. Su Ying chuckled in response. He then questioned if it was truly impossible, to which Su Ying explained that while there were methods, only a normal person wouldn't be able to do it. Cheng Dale humorously remarked that he was a completely unusual person, except for his somewhat handsome appearance. Su Ying responded with a silent gaze. Su Ying suggested that Cheng Dale's village could trade peppers for food. She explained that Fallen Leaf City was small in the context of Yuzhu, which itself was a small province in the empire. The eastern part of the empire was poor, while the west and the south were wealthy, and the north was rife with thieves. Su Ying suggested that if Cheng Dale wanted to exchange food, he would need to travel to the south where he could obtain it from Yangju. As Su Ying marked the names of Yangju on the table, she explained that Yangju consistently had a bountiful harvest, providing enough food to sustain the entire country. Throughout history, it had always been the breadbasket of the world. Cheng Dale inquired how far Yanju was, and Su Ying mentioned that by traveling through Jiaju, Yanju, and Yuju, she foresaw that he would arrive in three to five months. Cheng Dale expressed concern, noting that by the time he returned, most people would already be dead. Su Ying maintained a normal expression as she listened to him. Su Ying then suggested an alternative. She explained that since Fallen Leaf City was located by the sea, Cheng Dale could take the water route, which would only take about five days with favorable winds. A complete round trip would likely take around half a month. Cheng Dale reacted with surprise, repeating, 15 days. Su Ying warned him about the potential dangers of the sea route, including turbulent waters, fast-changing conditions, pirates, bandits, and powerful locals. She explained that one disaster could mean no turning back. Many people had taken this route before, but they narrowly escaped by a hair's breadth. Accepting that it was his only viable option, Cheng Dale wrinkled his nose in resignation. He stated that it was the only thing left to do, he declared that it was settled, and requested that Su Ying prepare a big boat for him, expressing his desire to leave tonight. While standing up from his seat, he indicated his readiness to depart. Sun Ju, surprised by Cheng Dale's sudden departure, asked if he didn't want to stay a while. Cheng Dale replied that it was time for his departure and that he couldn't afford to rest now. In Flying Tiger Village, a person voiced their hunger and another person inquired if there was any food left. He then asked if the Toad Village had tens of thousands of pounds of grains. The person lamented their starvation and expressed a desire to live in Toad Village. Unmindful to them, Gao, a bystander in the distance, overheard their conversation. Kui Ran approached Gao with an idea. Gao, addressing Kui Ran as a military strategist, repeatedly asked Kui Ran if he had an idea and questioned if he had a way to acquire food. Kui Ran proposed sending a few of his men to sneak into Toad Village under the cover of darkness. Gao questioned if they were planning to steal food, to which Kui Ran replied that stealing would be difficult. Instead, he proposed setting fire to the granary of the Toad Village, vowing that if they were to die, they would die with them, and they would no longer let them go wild. He spoke with determination. Gao, looking at Kui Ran's distressed expression, remarked that Kui Ran was cruel. Kui Ran countered, stating that a gentleman did not possess a petty mind, and a true man was not without venom. He questioned why everyone should starve while the Toad Village survived. Gao expressed his disapproval of burning someone else's granaries, calling it an immoral act that could lead to the extinction of Kui Ran's family line. Suddenly, someone from the village interrupted their conversation with good news. He urged everyone to quickly go to the Toad Village, as they had an important announcement to make. Kui Ran wondered what Cheng Dale was up to, while Gao determinedly declared his intention to go and witness the situation for himself, stating that if Cheng Dale caused trouble again, they would burn his granary. After the announcement, people from Kyu New Mountain gathered outside Toad Village, and Gao's name was mentioned, stating that Gao was there. Gao inquired about the intentions of the Toad Village. A person responded, stating that they had just arrived and were unaware of the current situation. 
but guessing that the Toad Village had come up with some bad ideas again while murmurs of people behind circulated. Someone suggested joining forces with him to take down Toad Village. Just then, someone announced that the Toad Village gate had opened. White Wolf appeared and addressed Gao Fei Bao, reminding him that he owed her a few meals. Gao Fei Bao responded confidently, indicating that it would be easy to handle, while Liu Bei irritably urged them to leave, mentioning that they had nearly eaten the village dry. Gao's worried expression met his brother, and he asked Gao Fei Bao if Cheng Dale hadn't done anything to him. However, Gao Fei Bao reassured him that everything was fine and even remarked that he had gained weight. Joking about Gao's weight loss, Gao was taken aback, realizing that his worries had been unnecessary, considering the abundance of food in the Toad Village. Later, Cheng Dale emerged and addressed the crowd, catching Gao's suspicion. Gao angrily questioned Cheng Dale's motives, wondering why he had done that. Cheng Dale announced that they had good news for them. He happily announced that they would begin distributing oatmeal on that day. The crowd fell silent for a moment before erupting into noisy questioning, expressing doubts about Cheng Dale's earlier statements. Someone questioned if they had heard correctly. Doubt lingered as they wondered if Cheng Dale was trying to deceive them or if he had been simply bored. Gao confronted Cheng Dale, demanding an explanation for his actions. Cheng Dale expressed a frown and a sigh, stating that he had done it because he considered himself a good person. Attempting to restore calm, Cheng Dale announced that the porridge wasn't free. He looked for volunteers to join him on a mission, offering food and lodging. He emphasized that villages with skilled fighters should not keep them hidden and welcomed volunteers. Cheng Dale asked them if they knew what the word voluntariness was, to which everyone responded with silence. He then singled out Gao Fei Bao, cautioning him about leaving after benefiting from his village. Gao Fei Bao tried to explain but was cut off by Cheng Dale as he continued to call out to White Wolf, causing her to wonder. He also chose the other individuals from the crowd and called the bald head, instructing them to pack their bags, bring weapons, and gather there the following day. Lastly, Cheng Dale chose Zhao Zai Long, Zhang Fei, Zhu Shen Jai, and a group of Liu family elite sailors from Toad Village to accompany him. The rest of the people kept watch in the village to survey the situation. Early the next morning, Liu Jai pleaded with Cheng Dale to allow her to accompany him. Cheng Dale, gently patting her head, reassured her that this time they were going to work, not play, but promised that she could join him next time. Liu Jai blushed at his reassurance. Liu Jai insisted that she could contribute as well, sharing that her family members were all sailors, and she knew how to swim. She offered to take care of Cheng Dale during the journey. Cheng Dale just looked at Liu Jai and then proceeded to lift her onto the horse in front of him. Liu Jai, filled with surprise, let out a delighted smile as she settled herself in front of the horse. Cheng Dale advised her to hold on tight, and then he gave the command to depart. Liu Jai's slight melancholy immediately faded away. As they traveled from King New Mountain, the groups had now already arrived on the ship. Among the crowd, people diligently carried provisions on board. Zio Yi walked on the ship deck with a burdened expression, carefully lifting a heavy baggage onto the ship. Coincidentally, she crossed paths with Cheng Dale, who observed his people. Cheng Dale then noticed Zio Yi behind him. He greeted Zio Yi with enthusiasm, asking about Su Ying. Zio Yi responded irritably that Su Ying was unwell due to the wind and cold. Cheng Dale expressed concern, seeking reassurance about the severity of Su Ying's condition. Zio Yi casually dismissed his concerns, mentioning that Su Ying just couldn't come to see him off. In response, Cheng Dale remained optimistic, urging Zio Yi to convey his well wishes and promising to visit Su Ying upon his return. He advised Zio Yi to hurry back and take care of Su Ying. Zio Yi's tone remained indifferent as she relayed Su Ying's request for her to follow Cheng Dale on board and take care of him. Cheng Dale, pleased by the attention, playfully remarked on his newfound popularity lately. Zio Yi chose to remain silent, averting her gaze, indicating her lack of interest in his comment. Zio Yi expressed her confusion regarding Su Ying's intentions, questioning what Su Ying was thinking, and sighed with disbelief. Later on, a person announced to raise the sail, while another stated, let's go. As the ship departed from the deck, the system observed them from above, and suddenly a beep came from the system. Cheng Dale received a message, stating that he had accepted a task to help the bandits in the King Mew Mountains survive the winter. However, on the first day of departure, all the mountain bandits were wiped out. They were seen lying on the ground, with one person expressing that he couldn't do it anymore. Cheng Dale, overwhelmed with concern and self-blame, remarked that he knew those mountain bandits had nothing to eat on the mountain, so he took them to Yangzhou to find food. But the grim reality struck Cheng Dale further as he didn't know the bandits were all seasick. Helplessly, he lamented his lack of foresight, noting their very wild behavior on the ground. While on board, they immediately panicked. The members felt discomfort. A bald man grunted and groaned before collapsing in nausea, while White Wolf struggled with dizziness, gazing out towards the ocean. Gao Fei Bao expressed grim feelings as if he had enough and threw his vomit into the ocean. Amidst the situation, Cheng Dale remained silent, 
Closing his eyes as exhaustion and frustration settled in. As the night wore on, Cheng Dali's thoughts turned to finding solace in rest. However, upon opening the door to his quarters, he was taken aback by the sight of Su Ying, who was dressed in revealing clothing, rummaging through her belongings. Perplexed by the situation, Cheng Dale questioned his own view, wondering if he had gotten seasick and caused hallucinations. Breaking the silence, Su Ying called out to him, breaking Cheng Dale's imagination with a simple hey. After a while, inside Cheng Dale's room, he cleared his throat as he smiled, his face still bearing the red mark from the slap. He questioned Su Ying about her sickness and asked about her presence there. Su Ying pouted in response, stating that she had decided to accompany him because he couldn't handle business on his own. Cheng Dale, in a cute and innocent manner, expressed his concern, mentioning that he hadn't seen her all day. He wondered when she had boarded the ship. Su Ying glanced at Cheng Dale and revealed that she had disguised herself as a boy and boarded the ship early in the morning, which was why he hadn't noticed her. Speaking of Yang Zhu's wealth and many messy rules, Su Ying emphasized that wearing old clothes would lead to being looked down upon by others and just not wanting to do business with him. She handed Cheng Dale new clothes, stating that he needed to wear them when he arrived. Curiosity peaked, Cheng Dale touched the fabric of the clothes and inquired if she had embroidered them. Su Ying maintained silence, avoiding eye contact. Cheng Dale admired embroidered clothes, realizing the incredible amount of time and effort that must have been put into creating them with thousands of needles and threads. Meanwhile, Liu Zhai happily approached Cheng Dale's room, calling out to him in excitement, but she fell silent when she saw Su Ying. Su Ying and Cheng Dale both turned their attention toward her. Su Ying greeted Liu Zhai warmly, acknowledging their long time apart and asking about her well-being. But Liu Zhai responded with a snobby attitude, stating that she was now Cheng Dale's servant and couldn't be addressed as Miss. Su Ying maintained a friendly smile, asserting that they knew each other when they were young. She also expressed gratitude to Liu Zhai for taking care of Cheng Dale. However, Liu Zhai sternly reminded Su Ying that she was now Cheng Dale's servant, and serving him was appropriate, but hearing gratitude from Su Ying's mouth was inappropriate. Cheng Dale observed the tense interaction between the two ladies, feeling surprised and realizing that there could be superficial friendships even in ancient times. With 100,000 guan in Cheng Dale's pocket, he traveled by wind to Yangzhou. The ship adapted to the wind, the wind adapted to the ship. And along the way, the wind and waves were calm, so they arrived in Yangzhou five days later without incident. Gao Feibao commented with a smile, noting that in Yuzhou, Cheng Dale also wore such an outfit. Cheng Dale responded, emphasizing to Gao Feibao that they were noble people from the north. He suggested showing vision and elegance. He remarked against looking like country bumpkins who would bring shame upon themselves in the city. However, Gao Feibao wondered about their ability to possess vision and elegance and asked if they didn't have any. Undeterred, Cheng Dale advised him to pretend. At the bustling Yangju dock, amidst the lively atmosphere, an old man complimented Lu on his hard work and inquired about his well-being. But Lu brushed off the old man's concern and aggressively demanded money from him, accusing him of not paying for the month. He insisted on knowing how much money the old man had earned that day and forcefully wanted to get it. The old man defended himself, explaining that he had already made the payment yesterday. He questioned why Lu was demanding money again. However, the other man joined in, dismissing the old man's statement and wearing a wicked smirk as he insisted on the money being handed over. When the old person explained that he didn't have a single penny with him, Lu and his companions ignored his words and forcibly dragged him away. Lu responded with annoyance, calling him a poor bastard and telling him to leave and not get in his way. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale reminded his group to address him as a prince once they left the ship, emphasizing that they were noble people from the north and needed to shed their banditry habits from the mountains and adapt to the civilized and polite atmosphere of Yangzhou. Noticing Cheng Dale and his group heading down from their ship, they were confronted by Lu and questioned upon their arrival. He asked if it was their first time in Yangzhou and if they were familiar with the rules of the city. He then introduced his gang, the Cao Gang, and emphasized that those who entered their territory for business must adhere to their rules. Su Ying enlightened Cheng Dale's group about the influence of the Cao Gang, which came from the canal, and there was always such a group of people gathering at the docks around the world to prey on them. Additionally, they used knives and sticks to conquer their territory and fought another gang and suspected that Lu was in charge of that dock, arriving freighters, middlemen who did business, hardworking workers, and carried sacks. She clarified that even beggars had to give a portion of their earnings to the Cao Gang. Shenji acknowledged the presence of the Cao Gang, referring to them as buddies. He began apologizing for any trouble they had taken on, but before he could continue his speech, Lu aggressively interrupted him. He sarcastically questioned Shenji, asking who their buddies were and where it came from. 
Shenji just silently looked at him with a blank face. Liu declared that the Cao Gang always took a tenth of the goods as their share. He further stated that the Cao Gang had the decision to decide who could sell their goods and who couldn't. Shenji expressed surprise at the concept of decimation, questioning whether it meant that 10% of their goods would belong to the Cao Gang. However, Cheng Dale interrupted and fiercely questioned what would happen if he refused to follow these rules. Liu justified the rules by claiming that people and goods could not be allowed to get off the boat without following the rules. He expressed suspicions that there might be something hidden underneath their boat, such as mountain bandits or pirates. Liu further asserted, with a grin on his face, that the Cao Gang provided protection and stability. Cheng Dale responded confidently, brushing off the rules as a mere desire for money. He claimed that he could easily provide enough food and drinks for a lifetime with just a few dates from his fingertips. With a smirk on his face, Cheng Dale invited Liu to take a closer look, promising to show him a treasure. Liu commented on Cheng Dale's appearance, noting that he was dressed like an overnight millionaire. But he expressed surprise that Cheng Dale seemed to be familiar with how things were going there. With a smile on his face, Liu stated that he didn't care if Cheng Dale knew the rules and asked him what he had with him. Cheng Dale invited Liu to take a closer look with a smile on his face. In a surprising turn of events, Cheng Dale unsheathed his swords and swiftly attacked Liu, slashing him in an instant on his throat. Liu fell to the ground, shocking both his gang members and Cheng Dale's group. Gao Feibao, White Wolf, and Shenji were taken aback by Cheng Dale's unexpected act of violence. Gao Feibao couldn't comprehend his actions despite his earlier emphasis on civility, politeness, and courteousness. Shenji reflected on Cheng Dale's past as a mountain bandit in Toad Village and realized that he had never been like that. Cheng Dale confidently announced his arrival, proclaiming himself Prince Appa and declared his authority to set the rules for the area. He responded to Lu's comment about his attire, expressing his indignation and revealing that the robe he wore was embroidered by his wife. Su Ying, curious about Cheng Dale's wife, questioned him. Suddenly, the shocking news of Lu Zai's murder spread quickly among the people on the dock. People asked who died, and others responded that it was Lu Zai from the Cao Gang who was killed. Some expressed disbelief that someone would dare to kill him in the Cao Gang's territory, while others rejoiced, feeling that Lu Zai deserved it and should have died long ago. As chaos ensued, the remaining members of the Cao Gang arrived at the dock and encircled Cheng Dale's group. Liu Zhai, who stood behind Cheng Dale, trembled with fear, but Cheng Dale reassured her not to be afraid. One of the Cao Gang members confronted Cheng Dale, questioning where he came from and criticizing his act of killing someone before even leaving the ship, deeming it savage. In response, Cheng Dale defiantly challenged the Cao Gang member, demanding to know who he was. The Cao Gang member, Lai Jiaming, introduced himself as Lu's deputy and stated that he was there by order of Master Sun to settle things there. Cheng Dale, unimpressed, belittled Lai Jiaming by asking if he was qualified to talk to him and expressed disdain about the place where there was no one who understood the rules in Yangju. Lai Jiaming frustratedly called him in anger. Tensions escalated as Lai Jiaming called for revenge on Master Lu prompting Gao Fei Bao to show that he was ready, while Zhang Fei asked Zai Long if he would do at that time. While the other member by Cheng Dale, who were on the ship, prepared their arrows, ready to engage in battle. However, Cheng Dale, now professing his recent belief in Buddhism, remarked that they didn't want to cause more deadly karma. Liu Zhai displayed a happy face while Cheng Dale patted her. Lai Jiaming contemplated the fierceness of Cheng Dale's group, realizing they had killed without hesitation and reluctantly decided to let them pass. Cheng Dale insulted Lai Jiaming before demanding to be directed to the best inn in Thousand Boat City, causing Lai Jiaming to feel frustrated, thinking that Cheng Dale had a big mouth and wondering where Cheng Dale came from. However, Lai Jiaming directly responded that it was in Yuyang Tower, asking Cheng Dale why he had asked. Cheng Dale calmly replied to Lai Jiaming that he would rest in Yuyang Tower that day and instructed Lai Jiaming to have their leader come to him that night. Though enraged, Lai Jiaming recognized the dress and mannerisms of Cheng Dale that matched with nobles from the north, and the battle-hardened soldiers accompanying Cheng Dale. He reluctantly allowed them to pass, but one of the gang members expressed disdain about Master Lu's death. Cheng Dale then announced to his group that they would disembark. However, Lai Jiaming halted Cheng Dale for a moment and expressed that Cheng Dale had killed someone from their cow gang, and someone would speak to him about it. He then inquired about Cheng Dale's name. Cheng Dale introduced himself as Appa U Fade, leaving Lai Jiaming to recite his name. One of Lai Jiaming's members asked him what they should do and frustratedly questioned whether they should just let Cheng Dale go like that. 
Lai Jiaming instructed his members to report the encounter to Master Sun and expressed a determination not to let Cheng Dalei's group off the hook. Most Liu soldiers stayed on the ship to guard it, and the people who left the ship went to the Yuyang Tower to settle down. Everyone was split up to find traders who could negotiate with them for grain. Cheng Dalei, Zhang Fei, and Sai Long were walking. Cheng Dalei showed interest in Yangzhou, stating it had been a flourishing place for thousands of years and the dream of many talented poets. He compared the flowing water under a small bridge to the beauty of a woman. As they strolled, Cheng Dalei expressed his knowledge that Thousand Boat City was not the wealthiest city in Yangzhou. He pondered about the capital of the Yangzhou Prefecture. Engaging in conversation, Sai Long remarked that the place was renowned not only for its rich literary culture, but also for being a hub for rare and high-quality weapons, known to be difficult to find elsewhere in the world. Intrigued, Cheng Dalei called upon his system to provide information about Yangzhou City. The system shared that Yangzhou had indeed been a hub of talent, listing various skilled individuals, including those with excellent manners, renowned painters, skilled tailors, exceptional matchmakers, talented woodcutters, and proficient fortune tellers. Reflecting on the system's information, Cheng Dalei realized that the number of extraordinary talents seemed rare among the millions of ordinary people. Meanwhile, Zai Long's attention was captured by something they spotted as they walked prompting him to express curiosity with a questioning look on his face. While Cheng Dalei was still thinking about the situation, the village now had four people with legendary potential. He felt hopeful about the future, believing that things were heading in a good direction. Amidst his musings, a person suddenly announced that it was Wu Tianjai's 50th birthday, the owner of the Golden Dragon Security Company. In celebration, the company organized a 10-day event known as the Golden Ring. The purpose of this event was to enhance the reputation of the Yang Golden Security Company and to host a party where individuals from the business world were invited. He further announced that regardless of the outcome of the performances during the event, there would be a reward of one or two fees for all participants who appeared on stage. The announcer informed the crowd that surviving ten rounds against the Ring Guardian would grant them entry as a guest in the Golden Dragon Security Company. Furthermore, the victorious challenger would be rewarded with 200 tails of snowflake silver. A person in the crowd remarked that the ring keeper was their chief security guard, Luo Yinshan, and wondered who could possibly defeat him. In the intense battle inside the ring, Luo Yinshan, as mentioned by the person in the crowd, delivered a powerful punch to his opponent's face. He then forcefully grabbed the man's wrist and applied such pressure that the man's hands were broken causing him to vomit blood and lose consciousness. Amidst the battle inside the ring, another person remarked that Liu Yinshan was renowned as the Iron Claw Eagle. With his iron whip, he had dominated the business world for many years without ever losing a bodyguard. Upon hearing this, someone suggested bringing him down and using the promised reward money to treat his injuries. Yin Shan, who had just won the battle, addressed the crowd, emphasizing the dangers of the ring and inviting those with real talent to challenge him thereby forging friendships through martial arts. With determination, he warned those without skills to avoid making fools of themselves and risking death with his iron claw. Seizing the moment, Cheng Dalei instructed Zai Long to cripple one of Yin Shan's arms, which Zai Long accepted with a smirk. Zhang Fei, laughing hysterically, showed a determined expression and suddenly ran into the ring area to fight Yin Shan, surprising Cheng Dalei who called Zhang Fei in horror. Yin Shen sternly questioned Zhang Fei's intentions, criticizing his reckless behavior and emphasizing that the ring was meant to be a martial arts event, not a platform for causing harm to others. Zhang Fei dismissed Yin Shen's concerns and expressed his eagerness to engage in the fight. He confidently proclaimed that he would assume the role of Yin Shen's teacher and demonstrate the true essence of martial arts. Yin Shen challenged Zhang Fei to choose between fighting with fists and kicks or using weapons. He pointed to the weapons available nearby, specifically mentioning the iron lasso he had chosen as his weapon. Zhang Fei grabbed a spear from the weapon area and charged toward Yin Shen, launching a rapid attack. However, Yin Shen reacted quickly, using his iron lasso to block Zhang Fei's assault. As the battle ensued, Yin Shen, impressed by Zhang Fei's fierce spear technique, gritted his teeth as he jumped sideways to dodge the spear. Zhang Fei's attack left an impact on the battle ring ground, causing a hole. Zhang Fei followed up with another swing, leaving Yin Shen unable to position himself properly as he tried to evade the attack. Yin Shen, struggling to avoid Zhang Fei's relentless attacks, thought that the first two moves had such a powerful name and questioned what the name of the third movement was, as he gritted his teeth even harder, leaving him focused solely on defending himself against Zhang Fei. 
Cheng Dalei observed the intense battle in the battle ring and expressed his admiration for Zhang Fei's skills, noting how he had pushed his opponent to the limit. Cheng Dalei observed Zhang Fei's astonishing growth and couldn't help but be amazed. Despite the little time he had to learn the three-handed spears technique, Zhang Fei had managed to level up so fast. When Zhang Fei was about to attack, Yinchen found an opening and delivered a strike to Zhang Fei. Zai Long commented on Yinchen, stating that he had forced Zhang Fei to take less than three steps, noting that Zhang Fei's spear could no longer be used. Yinchen managed to grab hold of Zhang Fei's spear, leaving Zhang Fei unable to use his moves effectively. Zhang Fei realized the disadvantage he was in. Meanwhile, Yinchen, revealing a sinister grin, took out a hidden knife from his iron lasso and aimed to stab Zhang Fei. However, before Yinchen could deliver the fatal blow, Zai Long intervened. With a swift and powerful technique, Zai Long jumped into the battle ring, separating Yinchen and Zhang Fei, and creating a cloud of dust. Zai Long then confidently spoke, telling Zhang Fei that he could watch the battle and assuring him that he would handle Yinchen while smirking. Upon witnessing Zai Long, the crowd, especially the girls, were captivated by his charm. They cheered for him, expressing their admiration and finding him incredibly handsome. Somewhere in Yangju City, the battle between Zai Long and Yinchen took place. Now, Zai Long was the one who faced Yinchen in an intense confrontation. Yinchen was surprised by Zai Long's appearance and questioned where he had come from. He compared Zai Long to Zhang Fei, noting their similar abilities. Despite Zai Long's youth, Yinchen spared his life but told him to leave the battle ring. The crowd cheered in response. Zai Long confronted Yinchen, his face filled with seriousness, and asked if he intended to take Zhang Fei's life. Yinchen dismissed Zai Long's concern, stating that Zhang Fei was just a delusional person without any real ability. He declared his intention to teach Zhang Fei a lesson and even threatened to take one of his eyes to make him realize his limits. Refusing to back down, Zai Long declared that he would make only one move. If Yinchen could withstand the attack and survive, Zai Long would spare his life. Suddenly, Zai Long showed immense power to Yinchen, while the crowd of girls erupted in cheers for Zai Long. Amidst the cheering, Zhang Fei urged Zai Long not to spare Yinchen and teach him a lesson. Zai Long unleashed his intense power, enveloping himself in flames, and questioned Yinchen if he could stand it. The system popped out and expressed astonishment at Zai Long's intense power skills. Cheng Dale, on the other hand, contemplated the significance of legendary martial arts and wondered about the high combat power bonus they possessed. In the battle ring, Zai Long jumped and attacked Yinchen in the air with the flames surrounding him. Yinchen covered himself with his iron lasso and pleaded desperately, unable to withstand the blinding lights emitted by Zai Long. However, Zai Long unleashed a powerful attack that engulfed Yinchen. After the attack, the battle ring was covered in smoke, and Yinchen was suffering from injuries and made an effort to get up. The girls in the crowd erupted in celebration, throwing pouches of money in the air and forming heart shapes with their eyes. Meanwhile, Zai Long, leaving the battle arena with his prize, informed Cheng Dale that he had completed the task. He then expressed surprise at the number of girls approaching him. They bombarded him with questions and invitations, expressing their admiration and interest. Some asked about his age and marital status, while others offered him tea or invited him to their homes. The girls cheered and were thrilled at the sight of Zai Long. Overwhelmed by the attention, Zai Long blushed and tried to push the girls away, refusing their advances. Cheng Dale attempted to calm the situation, reminding everyone that Zai Long was still a child and that they shouldn't be like that. He acted as Zai Long's agent and urged the girls to calm down. He humorously stated that Zai Long was tired and in need of rest. However, all the effort he made was not effective. Cheng Dale then cut the bag and threw the prize money in the air, and gold coins rained down from above, causing the people in the area to be surprised. As everyone scrambled to grab their share, Zai Long, taking advantage of the chaos, managed to escape the crowd. Cheng Dale, relieved, suggested that they withdraw. Exhausted, Zai Long agreed with a pouty expression. Cheng Dale expressed his surprise at Zai Long's potential to become an idol. Just then, a woman in the chaos spotted Zai Long. As they continued walking, the sun began to set, casting a warm glow over the city. Zai Long, curious about the concept of an idol, questioned Cheng Dale about it. Cheng Dale struggled to find an explanation and mentioned that people like himself could be considered idols. After a while, they arrived at Yuyang Tower. Cheng Dale entered the hotel, and a man approached him, informing him about a treasure debate conference. If he was a guest of the hotel, he could attend. He politely explained that it was an opportunity for networking and exchanging information with businessmen from the north, 
and the South. If Cheng Dalei had an interest, he could look at it at night. Cheng Dalei considered the Treasure Debate Conference, mentioning that if he had the time, he would watch it. However, he was busy in the evening, depending on the available time he would have. He then instructed the man to inform all the servants to stay out and only deliver food each day. The man responded affirmatively but questioned the ability of the clumsy hands and feet to handle the needs of the distinguished guests. Even the scouts who were sent away today gradually returned. Liu Jai and the little white wolf shopped all day long, but they only bought some brushes and powder from Yangju. While Shenji and Gao Feibao walked around, they went to the pub to drink wine. Cheng Dalei sighed as he touched his forehead, feeling a headache coming on as he thought about his group that didn't do their job. Cheng Dalei informed the group that they wouldn't be going out to scout for information the next day. He suggested that they gather information from the merchants in the Yuyang Tower, as it would be a convenient place for inquiries. He emphasized the need to acquire grain quickly and leave because they did not have much time left. Later, in Cheng Dalei's room with Liu Jai, they discussed the treasure debate conference. Liu Jai explained that it was organized by a wealthy businessman who had invited people to gather, drink tea, and discuss. There were traders from the West who sold exotic females, clothes, and novelties. Cheng Dalei expressed his interest and responded that it was worth visiting. Liu Jai shifted the topic and suggested that Cheng Dalei should wash his face and take some rest, considering he must have been exhausted from the trip. She mentioned that she had fetched some warm water for him. Before she could finish her sentence, the room door opened, and Su Ying entered with another pot of warm water. Su Ying expressed surprise, and Cheng Dalei innocently smiled at her and questioned why she had brought water. Su Ying sarcastically remarked that she wanted to drink the water. Liu Jai, joining in the sarcasm, mentioned Su Ying's large stomach volume in a playful tone. Su Ying asked if she had come at a bad time and Liu Jai reassured her, saying it had been a while since they had done anything together. The atmosphere in the room grew awkward, but Cheng Dalei managed to maintain a smile. Su Ying felt awkward, while Liu Jai found relief from the warmth of the hot water. At the Yuyang Tower, a gathering of literati was taking place, but it was nothing more than a few literati meetings to talk about the tea ceremony, calligraphy, and painting, poetry, singing, and amusing themselves sexually. One person suggested using winter as the theme at this time of the year. Then suddenly, a man's voice interrupted the moment as he expressed his feelings for Miss Wan through a lovely poem he had made. Miss Wan seemed to be amused and told the man, whose name was Prince Tang, that he was a talented poet. They began to exchange compliments with each other as Prince Tang said that the poetry of the world could not compare with Miss Wan's beauty. They started to become flirtier with each other as Prince Tang suddenly laid Miss Wan on her back and asked about how her lipstick color would taste on her lips. As they were about to engage in the deed, sudden footsteps were heard outside, and Prince Tang was surprised to find out that there were two men watching them. Zhang Fei then introduced themselves as they were also guests in the house. They had heard about the gathering, so they decided to pay a visit and write poetry with their friend. Prince Tang was confused about where these two people came from. He first thought that they might have heard the sound of the song on the second floor, which is why they wanted to go upstairs to peep at the girl playing the song. As Prince Tang was trying to draw conclusions, he also reckoned that the wine had been drunk, the song they had listened to was also finished, and the mood had also fizzled out. He decided to try to find some fun with the two people. Prince Tang then asked them if they knew how to write a poem. Gao Feibao then replied that they had little knowledge about it. Miss Wan then joined the conversation and suggested that they should be served with pen and ink to admire the masterpiece of the two. Prince Tang agreed with the idea and set them up. He even volunteered to sharpen the ink for both of them so he could admire their literary skills for once. He added that if it was a poem or a lyric, if Miss Wan sang it, then it would certainly be a sensation in the city tomorrow. Zhang Fei and Gao Feibao seemed to be doomed as they thought the people around them were underestimating them. They were determined and promised themselves to write a poem that would shock the people around them and would hit them hard in the face. They seemed to be confident as they had read so many books in their spare time, and that day, they would apply the knowledge even if their minds went completely blank. Zhang Fei suddenly stood up and announced that they had been careless and had disturbed their pleasure. He started to sprint outside as he asked for everyone's forgiveness, thinking they had been rude to them. Prince Tang told Zhang Fei to stop running and asked if he really wanted to leave already. He then told him that they must have been bandits. Zhang Fei replied that he and Gao Fei Bao were too uneducated to do that. He then added that he was sure their prince could write it when he arrived. Prince Tang was doubtful of Zhang Fei's answer and asked if he really called his prince and if he was not going to run away. As Zhang Fei was about to address Prince Tang's doubtfulness, he was kicked out and told to go alone. 
They wouldn't believe that savages from the north could write poems. Zhang Fei was outside when he called his prince, Cheng Dale, to come quickly as something bad had happened. Cheng Dale then asked what it was all about, and Zhang Fei told him that the people inside wouldn't let them leave. Meanwhile, at the gathering, Prince Tang was with Gao Fei Bao and told him that if Zhang Fei ran away, he himself would take him to the judge. Prince Tang reminded him what he was capable of, as one message from him to the head of the city could lead him to death. Zhang Fei came back with Cheng Dale, who asked everyone if this was the gathering of literati. He expressed his interest and said he would spare today to show what he was capable of. Prince Tang greeted him to sharpen the ink, thinking Cheng Dale was just all big mouth. As Cheng Dale grabbed the ink, Prince Tang then asked if he would write or not, as it took some time for Cheng Dale to start. Prince Tang started to mock him and compared him to his men who could not think of anything. But in Cheng Dale's thoughts, he was just trying to decide which poem he should copy. His options were a Tang poem, a Song poem, or a Yuan poem. He had too much in his stash. Cheng Dale started writing down, and Prince Tang tried to distract him and asked if his handwriting had not been taught by a teacher, to which Cheng Dale totally agreed. Prince Tang could not believe what he had just seen as Cheng Dale created a masterpiece. Looking at the Great Wall and beyond, there was nothing left but a vast expanse, up and down a great river, the loss of the monstrous. Prince Tang was debating in his mind, telling himself that it was only when he felt the mountains in his chest that he would be able to feel the mountains in his poems. The mountain was danced by silver snakes, the plain was walked by wax elephants, confronting heaven in stature. Prince Tang was surprised by what he had just witnessed. He became curious about Cheng Dale Da Lai's heart as he wrote such wonderful poetry. It felt like a great mountain lay on it. Everyone in the building was in awe as they witnessed Cheng Dale's work. On a sunny day, look at the enchanting red dress. The rivers and mountains were so beautiful, and they attracted numerous heroes to climb on them. Cheng Dale then halted his work as he realized that the next part couldn't be written by him. The following were the Qin Emperor, the Han Emperor, the Tang Emperor, and the Song Emperor. There was no such thing as a Tang Emperor or a Song Emperor in this world. Cheng Dale also mentioned the further generation of talent. He copied the wrong works and felt embarrassed. Cheng Dale decided to copy another poem that could not be copied and edit it out so that it would be less embarrassing to rewrite. Prince Tang was wondering why Cheng Dale stopped writing. But instead of asking him, he just outright told him that that was enough. Cheng Dale then looked at Prince Tang and asked what he meant when he said that was enough. Prince Tang clarified that the upper part was enough to shock the whole Jiangnan, and the whole piece would also shock the world, so it was better to stop. Cheng Dale then asked Prince Tang if they were now clear to leave, to which Prince Tang totally agreed. Prince Tang expressed his admiration for Cheng Dale's work as they were about to leave. As they left, Prince Tang was a bit surprised when he no longer saw the poem. Prince Tang was furious as one of the people who had gathered had hidden the poem Cheng Dale made. At night, outside Yuyang Tower, Jiaming announced the arrival of Cao Gang with their master son. The caretaker asked Jiaming about the reason behind the change in their relationship with the Trog Gang despite their consistent monthly contributions meeting the requirements. Jiaming rudely told the caretaker to mind his own business and leave. Besides, Jiaming's master son, whose name is DeLong, had arrived. DeLong then asked if this was the place where Cheng Dale lived, to which Jiaming confirmed that Cheng Dale had indeed stayed in one of the rooms. DeLong expressed his desire to see which young man had the audacity to make bold statements. After Cao Gang got inside, DeLong confronted Cheng Dale, who had calmly sipped tea. DeLong mentioned to Cheng Dale that he had heard someone wanted to change the rules for the pier. He then suspected that Cheng Dale was the one with a big mouth. Cheng Dale confidently confirmed and referred to DeLong as an old geezer. Frustrated, DeLong insulted Cheng Dale, saying he had little brains but plenty of courage. Jiaming confidently expressed his eagerness to chop up Cheng Dale first, while Cheng Dale lamented the lack of rules and discipline within the Cao Gang, remarking on anyone's ability to interfere. At the same time, a group of uninvited guests arrived in front of the restaurant. A man questioned if the person was present, to which another person confirmed having seen them enter the place. Determined, the man declared that they should not be spared and decided to take action. Jiaming informed DeLong that Hong Tianji from the Golden Dragon Security Company had arrived. DeLong wondered why they were here since there had been no previous conflicts with them. He peered out the window, pondering if Cheng Dale had been sent by the Golden Dragon Security to discredit the Cao Gang. DeLong couldn't help but suppress a laugh at the thought confident that the Cao Gang would remain unfazed. He finally decided to let them in. As they approached, Hong Tianji called out DeLong's name. Tianji questioned if they intended to free Cheng Dale from his persecution, speaking with authority. 
Inchen, in an angry tone, informed his master that it was the kid with the spear who had wounded him, referring to Xia Long. De Long questioned what they meant, reminding Tianji that he was the one supposed to support the kid. Both groups were surprised, simultaneously saying how. They then turned their attention to Cheng Dalei, who calmly sipped his tea. Cheng Dalei questioned who would refill his glass, ignoring the tension in the room. Tianji asked Cheng Dalei if he was the one who hurt Luo Yinchen. Cheng Dalei remained silent as he poured his cup. Tianji expressed his desire to punish Cheng Dalei by tying him to a flagpole and exposing him to the sun for seven days. De Long intervened, reminding Tianji that while Cheng Dale may have injured one of them, he had also killed a member of the Cao Gang. De Long stated that he couldn't let Cheng Dale die at the hands of others if he wanted to maintain the reputation of the Cao Gang. He then turned to Lai Jiaming and asked him about the punishment according to the gang's rules for such people. Jiaming replied that three blade strokes would have killed him and his body would have been fed to the dogs. Cheng Dale, still sipping his tea, listened to their conversation. Tianji objected, insisting that Cheng Dale should be handed over to the Golden Dragon's security, emphasizing their authority. Cheng Dale grew annoyed with their prolonged discussion, feeling frustrated and clenching his teeth in frustration. He then unsheathed his sword and challenged anyone to make a move, pointing his sword toward them confidently. DeLong was taken aback by Cheng Dalei's actions, as he was at the end of his rope and got surprised when he looked closely at Cheng Dalei's swords and asked for Cheng Dalei's name. A collective look of confusion spread across the faces of both DeLong's gang and the group from Golden Dragon Security. Cheng Dalei responded with his last name, Wu. DeLong, sweating a bit, asked if his full name was Gaijunk. Cheng Dalei, annoyed by their questions, asked if they still wanted to fight. DeLong quickly backed down, claiming he didn't dare. Tianji was confused by DeLong's sudden change in behavior. DeLong advised Tianji to leave, stating that the security issues related to Prince Wu were the Cao Gang's responsibility. He emphasized his commitment to protecting the prince's safety. Tianji questioned DeLong about his statement, expressing confusion. DeLong urged Tianji to leave immediately, stating that he was doing it for Tianji's own good. Cheng Dalei looked puzzled by the situation, while Xi Long expressed his irritation and asked if they still needed to fight. De Long chivalrously stated that if his guess was correct that Cheng Dalei's last name was not Wu. Cheng Dalei remained silent, startled by the remark. De Long smiled at his thought, convinced that his assumption about Cheng Dalei's last name was correct. His expression changed, assuring Cheng Dalei that he wouldn't expose his identity and emphasizing that he was responsible for large and small businesses. Cheng Dalei, puzzled by DeLong's mention of his identity, wondered if he had been discovered as a mountain hunter. As DeLong departed, Cheng Dalei smiled at them, and Sai Long maintained a stoic expression. After the Cao Gang and the Dragon security left the area, Sai Long questioned Cheng Dalei about his hidden identity that they didn't know. Cheng Dalei denied it, stating that he was also confused. He pondered over the identity of his swords and wondered who he should ask if there was something wrong with them. Meanwhile, DeLong and Tianji rode horses with their respective groups following behind as they headed home. Tianji asked DeLong about the significance of Cheng Dalei to him and why he had protected him. DeLong replied that he was not protecting Cheng Dalei, but rather protecting Tianji. Tianji expressed confusion and asked who he needed protection from. DeLong hinted that Cheng Dalei was the person that they couldn't mess with, pointing out the significance of his sword as evidence. Tianji questioned the importance of the sword, suggesting that in the business world, it held little value unless Cheng Dalei came from a wealthy family that used swords as decorative items. In contrast, DeLong mentioned that it was the common man's sword. Tianji repeated DeLong's statement about the swords, but his words were left unfinished as DeLong interrupted him, suggesting that mentioning it would be a sinful act against God, implying they didn't want to commit it. Shifting back to the 22nd year of Emperor Ming, iron was taken from Tianqin Mountain, and 14 swords were forged, a sword of the Son of Heaven carried by the Emperor of the Empire, and 12 swords of the vassals given to the 12 princes. There was a sixth prince who, since childhood, didn't want to study but preferred to associate with powerful merchants and porters. The Ming Emperor ignored his inflexibility and liked his frankness, so he had a sword made especially for him. The name of the sword is the Common Man's Sword. At Yuyang Tower, Cheng Dale stood alone on the terrace, his eyes fixed upon the glinting swords in his grasp. Lost in his thoughts, Cheng Dale recalled the sword left behind by Lai Xi. 
He commented on the sharpness and toughness, realizing that it could withstand the power of the ghost face axe. Cheng Dalei also recognized its significant value, knowing that it could fetch a high price. A question sparked within him, wondering if these swords held an emblematic meaning or represented an aspect of Lai Xing Zai's identity. Curious, Cheng Dalei wondered about the sword's meaning and Lai Xing Zai's true identity. With limited information and unable to ask the old man, he felt frustrated and eager to uncover the truth. Suddenly, Su Ying appeared behind Cheng Dale and asked him why he was still awake at such a late hour. She mentioned that she noticed a change in him since he had arrived in Yangzhu and wondered if something was on Cheng Dale's mind. Cheng Dale's response carried a touch of confusion as he asked if there was something on his face. Su Ying hesitated, her words stumbling slightly, implying that he appeared somewhat arrogant. Cheng Dale repeated her words, musing on them for a moment, sighing. He acknowledged the limited time he had, aware of the urgency pressing upon him. On the terrace, as Cheng Dale and Su Ying viewed their surroundings, suddenly the caretaker in Yuyang Tower approached them. The caretaker informed Cheng Dale that there was something important he needed to share. He mentioned that a guest from the Koshi wished to visit Cheng Dale but was concerned about potentially causing any inconvenience. Instead, the guest asked the caretaker to relay a message to Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale thought to himself that the news of the earlier events must have spread, achieving his goal of making a name for himself, even though it was a bit confusing. He then asked about the identity of the visitor, and the caretaker explained that it was Zheng Xing, who had invited him to the treasure debate conference that night. Later, inside the Koshi compound, Cheng Dale was greeted warmly by Xing. Xing expressed surprise at his timely arrival, mentioning that they had been discussing Cheng Dale just before his appearance. Cheng Dale explained that he had intended to visit Liu the previous night but had been preoccupied with daily tasks. Xing then invited Cheng Dale inside, urging everyone to gather and announce that the treasure debate conference would be divided into three parts, food, beauty, and exotic treasures. He then requested the exhibition to begin. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale sat at his table, observing his surroundings as the event started. One person mentioned that he had carried ten buckets of night pearls, resembling the appearance of their late father, and boldly recognized him as their godfather. A person then began discussing his famous cakes from the Wu family. Another person expressed interest and encouraged them to share more. However, there was a momentary interruption as another person called for the cake seller to be thrown out. But upon realizing that he had a wife named Pan, he decided to continue the conversation. Engaging with Cheng Dale, Zheng Xing, holding a cup of tea, playfully questioned why he wasn't eating the dishes, suggesting that perhaps the food didn't suit his taste. Cheng Dale responded by saying that he had already eaten something before and mentioned that Yangzhu was a small place. In terms of eating and living, it was still expandable. He expressed disappointment that Yangju couldn't even produce a dish that one could eat. Nonetheless, he stated that he didn't want to cause trouble and suggested putting the chili they brought in the kitchen so that the cooks could use it to prepare some dishes and send them over. Shortly after, some individuals arrived carrying dishes. Zing, while eating, questioned Cheng Dale about the ingredients Cheng Dale had added to the food. Cheng Dale proudly revealed that he had a special spice from his hometown called chili pepper, praising its ability to ward off the cold, give fragrance to the food, and enhance its taste. The aroma of the spice dishes captivated those present, with a man exclaiming at the fragrance while others expressed curiosity about chili pepper, something they had never heard of before. Some men invited Zheng to join them in trying it. Zing decided it would be impolite to decline the invitation. Zing coughed briefly, finding the food too spicy. However, he realized that spicy food could be traded for a good amount of money. Zing mentioned to Cheng Dale that he had heard about the load of peppers he brought. Cheng Dale confirmed it. Zing then proposed a deal, offering to buy the peppers for a price. Cheng Dale stated that he didn't want money but rather grain. Zing suggested a quantity of 300,000 pounds of rice to be delivered in seven days. Cheng Dale expressed his impatience, and Zing suggested a shorter time frame of five days. Cheng Dale expressed that he would have liked to accept the deal, but he didn't have enough time and could only wait until the next day. Zing acknowledged this and remarked that it would be challenging to find someone who could provide 300,000 pounds of rice in a day. Cheng Dale agreed to wait a little longer and mentioned that if he couldn't find a deal tonight, he would visit Zing again. Zing then shifted the conversation and stated that he had shown the beauty segment of the treasure debate conference. He then called for someone to bring it up and revealed two pacifiers he had bought from a Persian dealer at a high price, emphasizing their potential value as virgins that could fetch a high price in the capital. 
Cheng Dalei's thoughts wandered toward the notion of human trafficking, contemplating the presence of foreign women despite the empire's lack of contact with foreigners. He couldn't shake the suspicion that Zheng Xing was no ordinary Beijing businessman. Suddenly, Liu Jai spoke and expressed her fascination with the smooth garment on the woman's legs. Cheng Dalei, slightly taken aback, responded with a question, pondering when the stockings appeared in a historical context. Zing, noticing Cheng Dalei's interest, offered to send Cheng Dalei a batch of stockings if he liked them. Cheng Dalei responded with feigned excitement, imagining Su Ying wearing them and letting out an embarrassed chuckle. Su Ying, catching his train of thought, playfully remarked on his contemplative expression. Continuing their conversation, Zing then offered foreign girls as well as the 300,000 pounds of rice, suggesting they could provide pleasure for a few days before the rice was delivered in five days. Su Ying maintained a blank expression as she looked at Cheng Dalei, while Liu Jai appeared despondent. Cheng Dalei, feeling awkward, joined Zing in toasting and tried to divert the focus away from business matters, despite his embarrassed but secretly excited expression. Zing suggested that Cheng Dalei could hug one woman on the left and cuddle with the other on the right to enjoy all the blessings, stating that a normal vulgar woman would be boring. Cheng Dalei awkwardly laughed in response. Zing offered a drink to Cheng Dalei and suggested they continue drinking. Amidst the drinking, Liu Jai, who had been observing, suddenly displayed surprise. She clutched her chest, appearing worried. Su Ying, puzzled by Liu Jai's actions, looked at her with concern. Liu Jai's worried expression prompted her to call out to Cheng Dalei. Liu Jai called Cheng Dalei, who responded to her, asking what was wrong. She then whispered something in his ear. Cheng Dalei listened attentively as Liu Jai conveyed her concerns. Zing noticed and asked if everything was all right. Cheng Dalei reassured him, attributing Liu Jai's discomfort to having eaten too much chili and experiencing some stomach upset. However, Liu Jai's worried expression persisted, hinting at something deeper. Interrupting the conversation, a servant informed Zing of a person outside who wished to sell something. In Zing's mind, Cheng Dalei quietly reassured Liu Jai, telling her not to worry. Liu Jai responded with just a murmur. Zing dismissed the servant's concerns, deeming them trivial. He expressed his frustration at the interruption, stating that it had ruined their fun for no reason. Cheng Dalei intervened, suggesting that they let the man in to see if he had anything valuable to sell. Zing agreed to Cheng Dalei's request and allowed the man to enter. The man entered, carrying a large stick. Cheng Dalei asked the man what he wanted to sell, and Zing expressed his annoyance at encountering people in Yueyang Tower who claimed to be expert treasure hunters in the past. He revealed that his father had left behind a weapon. Cheng Dalei asked about the kind of weapon it was in its name. The man explained that his father, a former bodyguard, had found the weapon in the north and called it a serpent-headed spear. Suddenly, the system interjected with amusement at the sight of the weapon. Still at the Koshi compound, Cheng Dalei thought to himself how heavy the spear felt, and despite its age, it appeared to be an authentic piece. Curious about the price, Cheng Dalei asked about the cost of the weapon. The man responded, asking for a mere 100 coins. Cheng Dalei was taken aback, considering it surprisingly cheap. He glanced at the man before asking further. The man quickly lowered his price, stating that 10 silver coins would be enough for him. Cheng Dalei was confused by the drastic reduction. The man pleaded, asking for any form of compensation so as not to leave empty-handed. Realizing that the man was unaware of the true value of the weapon and had initially quoted 100 coins for the price to test his luck, Cheng Dalei decided to let him have the 10 coins if he was satisfied with only that. He then tossed the coins to the man, who eagerly accepted them with excitement. Cheng Dalei then told him to keep the change. Zing congratulated Cheng Dalei on acquiring the treasure and expressed curiosity about its specifics, hoping to expand their knowledge. Cheng Dalei told him that it was only a mere toy, unworthy of mention, and suggested moving on. As the treasure debate conference continued, every now and then someone came up with a treasure. The pearls of the southern ocean, the gems of the northern mountains, the sunken wood of the eastern sea, the beauty of the far west, but nothing that interested Cheng Dalei. After the meeting, many traders came to him, but they only bought a few hundred pounds of peppers. However, these were not the people he had been waiting for. Afterward, they returned to their rooms, and Cheng Dalei brought the weapon and presented it to Zhang Fei. As Zhang Fei swung the weapon above, Cheng Dalei noted that the weapon's ability made a sound like a dragon. Zhang Fei expressed his gratitude to Cheng Dalei, saying that the weapon was good to handle despite being a little old. He thanked Cheng Dalei, referring to him as the village master. The next morning, Cheng Dalei told DeLong to sit, but DeLong humbly refused, stating that as a prince, Cheng Dalei deserved the honor of having him serve even while standing. 
Confused by DeLong's visit, Cheng Dalei asked him why he had come. DeLong, using a cryptic gesture, questioned Cheng Dalei if he had paused midway in the sentence as he hinted using hand gestures. Puzzled by the gesture, Cheng Dalei mimicked the hand gesture, saying 666. DeLong smiled slightly, indicating that Cheng Dalei had understood correctly. DeLong reassured Cheng Dalei, referring to him as the sixth son, as an old servant who would never disclose his true identity. This made Cheng Dalei suspicious, wondering if DeLong had somehow discovered that he was a mountain bandit. Cheng Dalei made it clear to DeLong that it was enough for him to understand and emphasize not to tell it to anyone, to which DeLong readily agreed, showing respect by bowing. DeLong's emotions overwhelmed him, and he tearfully expressed how it had been 30 years since he had left the capital. He admitted that he hadn't expected the sixth son to have grown so much during that time. Cheng Dalei was puzzled by DeLong's reference to him as the sixth son and questioned who the sixth son was. Avoiding the topic of the past, Cheng Dalei urged DeLong not to dwell on it, describing life as stormy. DeLong, wiping his tears, acknowledged his emotional response. DeLong, on the other hand, openly acknowledged that he, the old servant, was overwhelmed with emotions while wiping away his tears with puffy eyes. DeLong's thoughts were filled with emotion as he reminisced about the past, feeling as if he had been transported back to that eventful autumn 30 years ago. 30 years ago, after the death of his parents, DeLong faced extreme hardships and starvation. Desperate to survive, he entered the government and became a eunuch, where he learned martial arts as a palace guard. Over time, his skills improved, and he eventually became a member of the emperor's personal guards. When Emperor Ming fled the capital due to the invasion of the Ring clan and military chaos, DeLong was separated while hunting through the rings and found himself in Yangzhou. Fearful of returning to the palace, he gained a firm foothold in Yangzhou, based on his fighting skills, coupled with the character of an aspiring wolf. He became a member of the Cao Gang, mentioning that he had been on a smooth path. After the Ring clan withdrew, DeLong didn't dare to return to the palace for fear of receiving the crime. However, he went back to watch the ceremony where the 14 swords were being forged. Apart from that, he never set foot in the capital again for 30 years. Despite having grown up in the palace, he has always considered himself a part of the royal family. DeLong thought for a moment about 30 years and let out a sigh. Shifting his focus back to Cheng Dalei, DeLong acknowledged his knowledge of Cheng Dalei's shipload of goods at the dock. He then expressed his interest in purchasing the entire shipload from Cheng Dalei. However, Cheng Dalei simply stated his requirement of receiving grain in exchange for the goods. DeLong swiftly inquired about the specific quantity of grain that Cheng Dalei desired. Cheng Dalei countered, stating he wanted 300,000 pounds of grain within a day. DeLong questioned whether that quantity would suffice. Cheng Dalei was taken aback by the request for 300,000 pounds of grain within a single day. He pondered the feasibility of such a demand and couldn't help but wonder why DeLong had the audacity to make such a bold request, especially considering that even Zheng Xing couldn't fulfill it. Skeptical, Cheng Dalei asked DeLong how much he could gather in a day. DeLong reassured him, expressing confidence that with the assistance of his cow gang, Cheng Dalei would be satisfied with the quantity by the next day. Cheng Dalei remained unconvinced and displayed an awkward expression. Before leaving the room, DeLong instructed Cheng Dalei to meet him at the pier the next day. Cheng Dalei remained silent, contemplating the situation. Following that moment, DeLong rode on a horse, urgently calling out to his group members, urging them to gather quickly and meet him at the pier. The sound of his voice reverberated like a bell, catching the attention of those dining in restaurants and going about their activities. Men glanced out of windows, one of them questioning what the old man was up to. Another man, intrigued by DeLong's urgency, urged others to hurry and join in. In the blacksmith's forge, a man entered and addressed Yinchen, who was working on forging a weapon as Master Liu. He informed Yinchen about the message sent by the old man, referring to DeLong. Yinchen, already aware of the message, acknowledged the man's words and motioned for him to come along. Even among the street laborers, some men urged their colleagues to hurry. Meanwhile, in the red light district, a woman approached a man named King, expressing her desire for him to stay with her for a while. King, adjusting his clothes, politely declined her offer, stating that he had received a message from the old man. He assured the woman that once he had taken care of the matter, he would return to spend time with her, playfully referring to her as a sweet demon. Following DeLong's command, the members of the cow gang, including rowers, blacksmiths, street laborers, and individuals from the red light district, all gathered at the pier. As the sun began to set, they arrived one by one, coming from various places in Yangzhou. DeLong confirmed the arrival of the ten tigers and eight dogs, and his men raised the red flag and confirmed their arrival. 
A bald man asked along about their tasks with a serious expression, while another man inquired about who they killed and how many. DeLong made it clear that he wanted rice, emphasizing the need for a substantial amount. DeLong showed a smirk on his face, referring to his followers as monkeys and instructing them to get to work. In response, all the men respectfully acknowledged the orders, bowing to DeLong in a show of obedience. The cow gang was a spider that had taken up residence in the Thousand Boat City. For 30 years, it had been spitting spider silk and weaving a great web. Today, the cow gang network was fully operational. The rice supplies in the city were swept away by the cow gang. The wharf was bought by the cow gang at a low price as long as the ship carrying grain had not yet docked. They sneaked into the official granary at night, and four or five people stole several carts of grain. Some large families in the cow gang talked to the ten tigers and eight dogs and finally gave out more or less food. But it wasn't until a day later, when this big web of the gang came to light, that people in the city knew that this big web was already so huge. The man had shown the whole city what he was capable of. The next morning, Cheng Dale, Su Ying, and Liu Jai arrived at the pier, shocked by the view that unfolded before them. Su Ying expressed her confusion, asking what was happening. Liu Jai remained silent, observing the situation with a surprised expression. Cheng Dale, equally perplexed, admitted that he didn't fully comprehend the events either. However, he speculated that perhaps the good people were not as bad as they initially seemed. In that moment, Cheng Dale felt a glimmer of hope for King New Mountain. At the pier in Yangju City, DeLong informed Cheng Dale that the grain he had requested was ready, totaling 5,000 pounds and divided into two deliveries. DeLong then extended an invitation for Cheng Dale to stay a few more days so that he could pay his respects. However, Cheng Dale declined, explaining that his wife and children at home were starving and couldn't afford to wait. He scratched his head awkwardly, expressing his dilemma. DeLong seemed surprised to learn about Cheng Dale's marital status and inquired further. Cheng Dale responded with an awkward laugh, while Su Ying and Liu Jai blushed and looked down, feeling shy, to which DeLong agreed. DeLong revealed that he had initially prepared ten maids, assuming Cheng Dale was traveling alone and could use their company, causing Cheng Dale's face to express excitement. However, since Cheng Dale already had maids with him, DeLong decided not to burden him further. He advised Cheng Dale, as a prince, to focus on poetry, meditation, and diligent rule rather than being seduced by beauty. Cheng Dale fell into silence, feeling a sense of sadness after DeLong's words. Later, they boarded the ship to return to their place. White Wolf happily leaned towards the ship, bidding farewell to Yangzhou. Gao Fei Bao expressed his enjoyment of the restaurant they had visited the previous night, and suggested going together next time. Shenji agreed with a smile as he wrapped his arms around Gao Fei Bao. As the ship set sail, people in the city waved and cheered for them. Among the crowd, a person called out for Cheng Dale to stay and begged him to remain with them. Others echoed the sentiment, pleading for Cheng Dale to stay and live among them. Cheng Dale asked Liu Jai about the willow branches being thrown toward their ship, and she explained that it was a gesture from the people to ask them to stay. Prince Tang called out to Cheng Dale, requesting him to write a poem about the current event. Although Prince Wu couldn't remain with them, Prince Tang expressed his desire for a poem from him as a way to commemorate his presence. Cheng Dale, with a wry smile, was aware that it was time to pretend once again to assume his poetic persona. He closed his eyes and pondered over various poems, searching for the one that would be most fitting for the occasion without carrying any unintended implications. As he mentally reviewed different poems, he set aside several options, considering their connotations and appropriateness to the current time. Eventually, he settled on a poem fragment, even though he couldn't recall the first half of it. Cheng Dale realized he had no more time to ponder and decided to use this poem. With a smile on his face, he called for Liu Jai to bring the wine, signaling the beginning of the poetic recitation. Raising his cup of wine, Cheng Dale addressed the crowd, starting to recite the poem, the paper was then, which was abandoned by the noble and virtuous people, and the knife and the pencil were of little use, therefore these must not be preferred before wine. With a joyful expression, Cheng Dale then drank the wine, stating that it was all in the wine, while Liu Jai stood behind him, sharing in his delight. The people continued to shout, urging Cheng Dale to stay. Some expressed their love and affection for him, calling out his name. Cheng Dale became fascinated, thinking he had many female fans. He couldn't help but feel flattered, thinking that he had acquired a sudden influx of female fans. The girls continued to shower him with attention, addressing him as Prince Zhao and Prince Zai Long, their excitement evident in their voices. Confusion washed over Cheng Dale as he realized that these enthusiastic fans were actually calling out to Zai Long not him. 
He was ashamed at the misunderstanding and felt slightly embarrassed for assuming they were his fans. Realizing his mistake, Cheng Dalei delightedly called out to Xi Long, who was hiding in a corner, and asked him to come and take a look. However, Xi Long remained hidden in the corner, wearing a blank expression. Xi Long hesitated before calling Cheng Dalei and explained that he had been locked in the restaurant for several days, unable to leave during that time. With seriousness, Xi Long continued, stating that he already had someone in his heart and wouldn't make a second choice. Cheng Dalei's expression turned curious yet blank, intrigued by Xi Long's confession. Couldn't help but want to know more about the person. Liu Zhai, joining in the conversation, playfully suggested that it could be a girl from their village, wondering which girl could have that luck. Her smile hinted at a hint of mischief. Xi Long frantically denied it. Cheng Dalei, mischievously teasing Xi Long, speculated whether the person he had feelings for could be a girl from Apricot Hill. He playfully suggested that the White Wolf could assist in bringing them together. Liu Zhai, jokingly mentioned Liu Bei, adding to the lighthearted atmosphere. Xi Long, feeling a bit embarrassed, revealed that the person he had feelings for was actually his senior female fellow student and pleaded with Cheng Dalei not to interfere in his personal matters. As the ship sailed, DeLong watched them from a cliff in the distance. His men approached him, offering a coat due to the strong wind on the water and suggested to him that they should go back. DeLong agreed to return. The man mentioned the boatload of goods and asked him what they should do with it while putting the coat around DeLong. He instructed his man to sell them if possible but if not, to come up with a plan to dispose of them. DeLong contemplated the recent events and realized that while they had successfully executed a great show, it wasn't necessarily beneficial for the reputation and honor of the cow gang. He let out a sigh, anticipating that the days ahead would be difficult. Suddenly, an old man approached DeLong, expressing gratitude for his hard work. The old man mentioned that he had heard about DeLong's achievement of collecting 400,000 pounds of rice in one day to monopolize the pepper market. He acknowledged that it was quite a big deal, but before he could continue, DeLong interrupted him. DeLong questioned whether the old man had approached him just to mock him. The old man expressed admiration for DeLong's courage and requested to purchase some of his pepper. He mentioned having the silver ready for the transaction and awaited DeLong's confirmation for the sale. As other people gathered around DeLong, they expressed their desire to buy the chili pepper. A young man pleaded not to be left behind and insisted on having a share. A woman also joined in, expressing her interest in purchasing the pepper. Even the old man reiterated his request, stating his intention to buy some. The Long, shocked by the overwhelming response, remained speechless, unable to respond to their requests. He cried as he asked Cheng Dale, addressing him as the sixth prince, to have mercy on him. One of DeLong's men alerted them to the strong wind, signaling that it was time to return. DeLong's gaze shifted towards their ship in the distance, realizing his earlier doubts about Cheng Dalei were unfounded, sincerely apologized to him. Meanwhile, at the Saidi tribe of the rings, a man dressed in a hoodie sweater sat near a crackling fire, cooking meat for his meal. The sound of the fire crackling reached his ears as he prepared to eat. Suddenly, he sneezed, causing him to question whether someone was thinking of him or if he had simply caught a cold. It revealed that the man was none other than Lai Zing Zai. As the sun set and cast its fading glow on the ship, Cheng Dale sat calmly at the mainmast, sipped his tea, as Shenji approached him, expressed his concern about the strong headwind, and informed him that the ship would only be able to travel in a zigzag line. He further added that it would take approximately 10 days to return back. Addressing the information shared by Shenji, Cheng Dale remained composed and calmly responded, expressing his hope that nothing would go wrong. Shenji confidently reassured Cheng Dale, stating that with the support of the Cao Gang, there was no reason for anything to go wrong. He emphasized that pirates or river bandits were no match for the Cao Gang, indicating that Cheng Dale worried too much. Cheng Dale, however, responded sternly, telling Shenji to shut up. Hours later, under the moonlit night, a group of pirates gathered in the middle of the vast ocean. A pirate asked if the two-legged sheep had arrived, to which another pirate informed the second boss that they were locked in the cabin. Another pirate informed the second boss that the captives were locked in the cabin. The big boss instructed them that they should go to Peking to unload the goods there, as the great personalities there liked the goods. However, the pirate asked about the two fat sheep. Another pirate relayed the news from their big boss sent from Yangju, stating that the target ship would arrive soon, and the boss had already sent the sister-in-law there. The pirates discussed their plan to attack the ship once it entered their encirclement, intending to kill the people on board while leaving the ship intact. 
Another pirate reassured the second boss, mentioning that there were over 50 people on the ship, including a nobleman as their leader. They anticipated the nobleman's fear when faced with a sword. Confidently, the pirate asserted that nothing had ever gone wrong when Skull Island was involved. They urged everyone to get to work. Back on Cheng Dale's ship, Shenji approached him, bringing news of several survivors rescued from the water and claimed to have been attacked by pirates, seeking refuge on their ship. Doubtful, Cheng Dale decided to check them himself. As Cheng Dale and others looked at the survivors, a woman among the group pleaded for Cheng Dale, referring to him as a graceful man, and requested his help to save them. In response, Cheng Dale asked them about their situation, questioning why they had been on the sea. The woman explained that they had intended to return to their hometown with their master, but encountered pirates along the way. Tragically, their master and his wife were killed by the pirates, and only a few of them managed to escape. She humbly pleaded with Cheng Dale to show mercy and to save them. Cheng Dale sighed, acknowledging the dangers that existed at sea and the importance of helping one another in times of need. The woman expressed her gratitude to Cheng Dale. Eventually, she flirtatiously said that she would repay her benefactor even if she became a cow or horse in her next life, accompanied by a seductive expression and a touch to her chest. Cheng Dale, taken aback by her remark, questioned her choice of being a cow or horse, suggesting that she should give her life instead. Confused, the woman responded with, what? Suddenly, Cheng Dale unsheathed his sword, his face filled with frustration and the intention to kill. He slaughtered all the male survivors accompanying the women and caused the woman to be shocked by what had happened. The woman saw blood splattered everywhere. Shenji, puzzled, questioned Cheng Dale about what he was doing, but Cheng Dale ignored Shenji's question. Cheng Dale, with his sword in hand, menacingly threatened the woman, stating that he believed she knew what it took to go on living and questioning her moral character. Additionally, he mentioned that there was a saying in this world that death was better than life. Cheng Dale sternly demanded the woman to answer a question quickly and face her death with flattery. Cheng Dale's voice was stern as he posed his first question to the woman, demanding to know who she was and why she wanted to join his ship. Liu Zhai stood silently behind him, casting her gaze downward. The woman's response was hesitant and filled with fear. She claimed not to know and explained that they were just a group of people in distress. Cheng Dale's voice carried a firmness that brooked no deception as he admonished the woman to stop pretending. He emphasized that in a situation where they had truly been invaded by pirates, the one with the most power would naturally assume control. Yet, these people seemed to follow her orders alone. With his sword pointed menacingly at her neck, the woman trembled under his investigation. He firmly stated that the ring appeared familiar to him, leading him to suspect that she was one of Zheng Xing's people. The woman's eyes widened. However, the woman stumbled over her words and attempted to hide her true identity. Cheng Dale's voice hardened as he confronted the woman's denial. He pointed out that the ring she wore was a precious heirloom of the Liu family, which should have been included in the city's treasury after their downfall. He demanded to know where she got it. With a fierce gaze and his sword still pressed against her neck, Cheng Dale suspected that Zheng Hexing might be involved in slave trading or piracy. The woman's fearful eyes met his intense stare and she attempted to respond but was unable to find the right words. Cheng Dale, driven by frustration and suspicion, swiftly slashed her shoulder, causing her to bleed. He continued to press and admonish the woman for her reluctance to answer. He warned her that if she failed to answer his questions promptly, she would not have a choice anymore. The woman cried out in pain and blood dripped from her hand. She mustered the courage to reveal the truth. She admitted that they were indeed members of Skull Island, under the command of Zhang Xing. Curious, he questioned the number of pirates lying in wait, seeking to gauge the magnitude of the potential ambush. The woman revealed that there were 200 men under the command of the second boss from their village. Liu Zhai, who had been silently observing, asked if the downfall of the Liu family was connected to the woman. The woman recognized Liu Zhai and exclaimed in shock, realizing that she was from the Liu family. Upon realizing Liu Zhai's identity, the woman's demeanor changed dramatically. She cursed the Liu family and regretted not having killed them all before. Liu Zhai, frightened by her outburst, backed away. The woman blamed Liu Zhai, expressing her anger and frustration that they could have made a fortune if Liu Zhai hadn't interfered and blocked their way. She gritted her teeth, directing her frustration towards Liu Zhai. Continuing her rant, she blamed city lord Fang Boshan for their current situation and expressed frustration that if he hadn't been concerned about others, they wouldn't be facing such consequences. She shouted in anger while Liu Zhai kept her gaze lowered. The woman unleashed her anger, revealing that they had not wiped out the entire Liu family but had left Liu Zhai as an orphan. 
With madness, the woman declared that those who stood in their way would always meet their demise, emphasizing her ruthless nature. She let out a piercing scream followed by a hysterical laugh, showcasing her twisted mindset. She confessed to having killed Liu Jia's father and sunk their fleet, expressing her dissatisfaction with the level of enjoyment they had derived from it. Furthermore, she mentioned how they had exterminated Liu Jia's entire family, except for a few remaining servants. In her delirium, she declared that it was now Liu Jia's turn to suffer, vowing that everyone on Skull Island would join in the slaughter, especially the women. Her words were filled with deranged intensity. In response, Cheng Dalei swiftly ended her life, cutting short her disturbing and menacing words. Shen Ji expressed his admiration for Cheng Dalei's intelligence, mentioning that the pirates had never expected Cheng Dalei to recognize them. He admitted that they had disguised themselves well and that he had almost fallen for it, but Cheng Dalei sarcastically questioned if he had truly been fooled. Shenji confidently stated that even if Cheng Dalei hadn't uncovered their true identities, he would have still warned him. He expressed his belief that the pirate's acting skills were enough to fool him. Cheng Dalei, feeling irritated by Shenji's annoyance, simply muttered to him to get lost. Shenji tried to comfort Cheng Dalei by acknowledging that while he might have been slightly less attentive than he was, he still performed admirably. Cheng Dalei, still puzzled, asked for clarification. He emphasized that given their current situation, even encountering people who didn't cause problems would be needed to kill them all. He then emphasized the importance of their ship, carrying 5,000 lives, and the need to avoid any risks. Raising his swords above, Cheng Dalei rallied his companions, urging them to prepare for battle, as the moon illuminated their path. In the distance, Cheng Dalei and his crew spotted the approaching Skull Pirates. Meanwhile, the lifeless body of the woman they had interrogated earlier floated in the sea. On the pirate ship, the man observed Cheng Dalei's ship. His thoughts raced with anticipation, stating that the target was in his sight. Thoughts raced through his mind as he planned to destroy the sails after they boarded the ship. The man introduced himself as Zheng Zinghan, as he recognized the strategic advantage of disabling the enemy's sails, likening a ship without sails to a defenseless girl in the hands of a robber's den, ready to be exploited. He eagerly awaited the opportunity to strike. However, before he could finish his thoughts, a fast and deadly arrow flew toward him. The sound of the approaching weapon startled him, and he managed to evade a second attack just in time. Arrows struck their mast, causing a loud bam in their ship and confusion among the pirates. Realizing the threat they faced, Zinghan shouted out orders to his crew, alerting them to the unexpected danger of the giant crossbow, and the realization that their information about Cheng Dalei's ship had been false. He urged them to prepare for the impending confrontation with their enemy. Amidst the crashing waves, the birds darted through the onslaught of fast arrows from Cheng Dalei's ship, targeting the Skull Pirates with intensity. Cheng Dalei's authoritative voice sliced through the roaring wind as he issued clear commands to his crew. With a pointed gesture to the northwest, he directed their focus and signaled the direction of their coming attack. The arrows launched by Cheng Dalei's group hit each of the pirates from the Skull Pirate ship. Zheng Zinghan swiftly ordered his crew to turn the rudder fully to the left, maneuvering their ship to evade the incoming arrows. With determination in his voice, he shouted, Kill! as they charged toward Cheng Dalei's ships. On Cheng Dalei's ship, he asked Zai Long about how far he could shoot at sea. Zai Long, confident in his abilities, responded without hesitation, stating that he could shoot within 100 steps. Cheng Dalei ordered Zai Long to provide cover from above with his bow and arrow, ensuring that for every one of their people who fell, one of the enemies would fall too. Zai Long acknowledged the command and got ready to launch his attack. Frustrated, he issued orders to Su Ying, Liu Zhai, and Zai Yi to retreat to the cabin if they were unable to fight. He noticed Shenji holding a knife and instructed him to also retreat to the cabin. He raised his voice and expressed annoyance at Shenji's action. Cheng Dalei gave the command to prepare the arrows. As the Skull Pirate's ship approached, one of Cheng Dalei's men started beating a drum, signaling the attack. Arrows rained down from the ship, expertly aimed by Zai Long and his fellow archers. Many pirates died as they were struck down by a significant number of pirates manning the enemy boat. Zinghan commanded his men to fire a barrage of fire arrows at Cheng Dalei's ship. Cheng Dalei's crew swiftly raised their shields to defend against the fiery assault, protecting themselves from the blazing arrows. Chaos ensued as their ship caught fire from the flaming arrows striking the gaff sail. Cheng Dalei swiftly commanded the crew to haul in the sails and stop the ship, allowing the pirates to get close. The two ships neared each other, and Zinghan urged his crew to board Cheng Dalei's ship and urged his members to kill Cheng Dalei's people. The battle unfolded with swords clashing, arrows flying, and the sound of metal meeting metal. 
The fight for survival intensified as the two crews engaged in a fierce and deadly struggle. In rage, Cheng Dalei commanded their people to draw their swords and urged his men to draw theirs as well, preparing for a fight to the death. The pirates managed to breach Cheng Dalei's ship, stabbing two of his crew members. Some pirates on the boat threw a rope towards Cheng Dalei's ship, successfully securing it above, and they began climbing up the rope to infiltrate Cheng Dalei's ship. Fortunately, Cheng Dalei's people quickly reacted, using their swords to stab and push back the invading pirates. With a display of strength and teamwork, they managed to fend off the attackers, sending them back into the sea. In the midst of the chaotic battle, Cheng Dalei and Zhang Fei, unaware of each other, fought side by side, fiercely defending their ship. Amidst the flurry of sword strikes and parries, Cheng Dalei called out, searching for Zhang Fei's presence. Upon hearing his name, Zhang Fei responded, confirming his presence and readiness to fight. Cheng Dalei, seizing the moment, issued a strategic command to Zhang Fei, instructing him with Xi Long to board the pirate ship kill the horses, and capture the leader before the others. Zhang Fei confirmed the order, briefly glancing back at Cheng Dalei. After Cheng Dalei ordered Zhang Fei, both Xi Long and Zhang Fei made their way toward the pirate ship. Xi Long urged Zhang Fei to cover him while Zhang Fei was overwhelmed by the fight and confirmed it. Meanwhile, Gao Fei Bao fought fiercely, taking down pirates left and right, and suddenly screamed his name. However, before he could finish his words, a pirate strike flew from behind, sending him flying as well. While White Wolf utilized her agile fighting skills, killing pirates surrounding her, one pirate who attacked her ordered his comrade to kill White Wolf. Undeterred, White Wolf responded by coming her way with Kunai in her hands as she was ready to fight. However, their fight was momentarily interrupted by a sudden and powerful explosion causing White Wolf and the others to pause and turn their attention to the source. Surprised, White Wolf looked up to see Zhang Fei and Xi Long clearing their path, causing all the pirates to fly as they attacked them. Then they jumped on the pirate ship. Zhang Fei announced his arrival, and a group of pirates surrounded them. Zhang Fei dared the pirate to fight with him to the death while showing a smile with determination. The pirates, taken aback by Zhang Fei's fierce appearance, taunted him as a gorilla-faced man and shouted for others to kill him. The pirates rushed, attempting to attack him, but Zhang Fei's combat skills kept them at bay, preventing anyone from getting close. He swiftly defeated the pirates, leaving them defeated on the ship's floor. Frustrated, Xinghan stared, asking Zhang Fei who he was. In response, Zhang Fei proudly announced his identity as the top general from the Toad Village on the Toad Hill, his face beaming with confidence. Zhang Fei then questioned Xinghan about who he was. Xinghan responded with a hint of confusion, mentioning the Toad Village, but quickly shifted his focus, stating that he would remember Zhang Fei. He proudly declared himself as Zhang Xinghan, the second leader of Skull Island, and swiftly launched an attack on Zhang Fei, wielding his two three-pronged spears. In the midst of their intense battle, Zhang Fei skillfully utilized his techniques against Xinghan. Observing the duel, Xi Long advised Zhang Fei to prevent Xinghan from getting any closer. As the fight continued, Zhang Fei successfully blocked Xinghan's attacks. With a powerful blocking move, Zhang Fei forcefully threw Xinghan away, remarking his combat skills catchphrase catch the pigs. Zhang Fei launched an attack on Xinghan, shouting with intensity. In response, Xinghan couldn't help but think about the weird name Zhang Fei had yelled. However, just as Zhang Fei's attack was about to land, a massive and powerful explosion erupted, shaking the ship. Zhang Fei's formidable skill was known as Grounded Pierce. Without giving Xinghan a chance to catch his breath, Zhang Fei relentlessly continued his assault, utilizing his skill known as Catch the Pigs. Meanwhile, Xi Long silently observed the battle, his mind filled with contemplation. In the midst of their clash, Zhang Fei announced his final attack, confidently proclaiming his last strike of Catch the Pigs. Xinghan, growing frustrated, cursed Zhang Fei and told him if he was finished. However, Zhang Fei pressed on, not giving Xinghan any chance to retaliate. He used the technique Poke in Heaven instead of Catch the Pigs he had said a while ago. He executed a piercing attack that struck Xinghan with such force that blood spewed from his body, leaving him in a state of shock. Tears formed up in Xinghan's eyes as he struggled to comprehend why Zhang Fei's attack, which he said was catch the pigs, used a different attack instead. He gave Xi Long a thumbs up and smiled at him, stating that Xinghan was pretty hard to handle. Xi Long, however, asked Zhang Fei who had taught him those moves. Zhang Fei confidently revealed that Cheng Dalei had taught him the move, emphasizing its effectiveness in targeting the heart and its usefulness. Xi Long looked unsure and didn't know how to respond. 
After a night of fighting, Toad Village lost five men, and the others were wounded more or less. Skull Island lost more than 50 people. The main ship was occupied by Zhang Fei, and the rest of the people could only take a small boat and flee in fear. As the sun rose, illuminating the aftermath of the battle, the group of Cheng Dalei celebrated their hard-earned victory. Suddenly, the system updated, showing the achievement of completing the hidden mission related to the Liu family. The system chimed, praising their victory. Back on the Thousand Boat, Yuyang Tower, Zheng Xing was deeply engrossed in playing his instrument, absorbing the enchanting vibrations it emitted. Suddenly, his concentration was shattered as his man approached him. The man stuttered as he conveyed a piece of news from the sea. Zing, surprised by the sudden interruption, asked about the status of the second boss and if he had completed all the tasks that he had instructed. The man's response was filled with distress. He revealed that their mission had ended in failure, resulting in the death of over 50 members of their group, including the second boss. The shocking revelation caused Zing to break a string on his instrument. Unable to comprehend, he exclaimed his disbelief aloud. Seeking to make sense of the situation, Zing questioned how their 200 men could have lost to a group of only 50 led by a drunkard. He yelled at his man, demanding answers. Nervous, the man explained that the people who escaped back reported that the opponents from Toad Village, particularly Toad Hill, had fought unexpectedly hard against them. Zing's eyes filled with tears of disbelief as he listened to the man's words. Zing muttered to himself about Toad Village while furrowing his brow in deep thought. Back at the ocean, White Wolf informed Cheng Dalei that the sails were being repaired and they would be ready to set sail in half an hour. She went on to share news about the capture of the enemy's main ship by Zai Long and Zhang Fei. They were in the process of transferring the captured goods, which included some gold and silver scraps. Notably, the main catch included foreign female slaves intended for delivery to influential figures in the capital. White Wolf then asked Cheng Dalei about their plans for the group of female slaves. Cheng Dalei deliberated on the matter, stating that they weren't sure if there were people from Skull Island among the captive slaves and noting that they didn't have time to save people. He proposed two choices, leaving them on the ship or killing them all. Expressing her objection, White Wolf, being a woman herself, couldn't fathom the thought of letting the girls die. However, Cheng Dalei emphasized the significance of their mission which involved carrying life-saving food for 5,000 people in King New Mountain, and if something happened, it would result in the loss of more than just a few lives. Overwhelmed by the weight of the situation, White Wolf found herself at a loss for words, unsure of how to respond. Cheng Dalei contemplated the actions of Skull Island, recognizing their cunning tactics as he considered the rescue of the group. He thought of the potential consequences, which might have been another ambush, and that would have led to their destruction if they hadn't taken care of those people. He recognized it as purely the trolley problem. Understanding the gravity of the situation, White Wolf proposed a compromise. She offered to watch over the captives and suggested not letting them out of the cabin, stating that if there were a problem, Cheng Dalei could blame her for it. Reluctantly accepting her proposal, Cheng Dalei agreed to assign additional guards and promise the captives their freedom once their journey was complete. White Wolf, relieved, expressed her agreement. After a couple of hours, one of Cheng Dalei's men approached him with news of the ship's repair. Cheng Dalei then commanded that they set sail. However, the return trip didn't go smoothly. On the way, they kept encountering alleged victims who had planned robberies on small boats. Halfway there, they found themselves in the middle of a storm and although they eventually weathered it safely, they lost two days in vain. As they battled the storm, panic set in among the crew. Cheng Dalei ordered the sails to be lowered. Shenji, panicking, expressed his fear, screaming that they were going to die, while Zhao Yi sought help from Su Ying. After enduring the hardships, the way there took five days, and because of the headwind, the way back was longer. Finally, twenty days later, the ship docked at an abandoned dock outside Fallen Leaf City in the night. Having arrived at their destination, Cheng Dalei instructed Zhang Fei and Gao Fei Bao to return to the village and call for someone to pick up the grain. As the night fell, Cheng Dalei found solace by a bonfire resting against a tree. Su Ying approached him, and as her footsteps made a sound, Cheng Dalei became alert. Cheng Dalei questioned her why she was outside in such chilly weather. Su Ying responded that she had come to keep him company. As Cheng Dalei noticed Su Ying wearing stockings, he remarked that stockings looked good on Su Ying, but he recalled her previous reluctance to wear them. Su Ying responded by saying that it had been simply too cold and wearing stockings had helped to keep the cold out, while seductively brushing her hair. Feeling the chill in the air, Cheng Dalei commented on the cold weather while both he and Su Ying sat near the bonfire, seeking warmth. Su Ying agreed as she also sat down to warm herself. 
Then, Su Ying turned her gaze towards Cheng Dalei and remarked that he hadn't closed his eyes for a long time in those days. Cheng Dalei expressed his concerns to Su Ying about the dire situation caused by the drought in Yuzhou, spanning thousands of kilometers. He emphasized the gravity of the food shortage, stating that if they were to leave the two big loads of food on the ship and someone discovered it, the consequences would be unimaginable explaining that his original plan had allowed for only 15 days, as the villages would have sufficed only for so long. However, the journey had taken a month to come back. Cheng Dalei further described the worsening conditions as they moved further north from prosperous Yangzhou, with the fleeing victims already in Qingzhou. He mentioned how desperate some people had become, even resorting to trading their teenage daughters for a bucket of rice. Expressed his distress, stating that people were dying everywhere and he was uncertain about the current situation in the mountains and whether they could still hold out. Cheng Dalei questioned how much longer it would last and how many people had to die. At that moment, Su Ying reached out and held Cheng Dalei's hands, offering comfort to the tension he was feeling. Su Ying advised Cheng Dalei to take a breath and reassured him that he had already done his job enough and they couldn't help the whole world, stating that it was good to have a clear conscience. She reminded him to stop pushing himself too hard. Then, Su Ying smiled at him, asking if it was still cold. Cheng Dalei hesitated but calmly remarked that her hands were actually colder. Feeling sad, she pouted in response. Cheng Dalei gently suggested that she should go back, as he needed to concentrate. Su Ying reluctantly agreed. After a while, Cheng Dalei's people alerted him to the arrival of someone. The sound of rushing horses filled the air. Gao, accompanied by a group of people, approached Cheng Dalei. They screamed, calling Cheng Dalei the village master, and bowed before him. Cheng Dalei cautioned them not to attract unwanted attention and hungry wolves nearby. Gao expressed his gratitude towards Cheng Dalei for his kindness and pledged that his life now belonged to Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei brushed off the gratitude for the moment and inquired about Gao's injuries, asking if something had happened in the village. Gao sighed heavily and decided to share the recent events with Cheng Dalei. He revealed that three days ago, Yu Qiu Ran had gathered a group of around 200 people to withdraw. However, before their departure, Yu Qiu Ran attempted to take the remaining food supplies with him. Gao stated that he was a little hurt when he argued with Qiu Ran. Eventually, Q Ran realized the futility of his plan but took advantage of the chaos to set fire to the remaining grain before fleeing with a group of people. The granary had been burned, leaving the mountain with no food. He shared his fear that if Cheng Dalei had not returned, the consequences would have been even more severe, gritting his teeth in frustration. Cheng Dalei sighed in frustration, finding the behavior of these military strategists ungrateful, wondering if their excessive book knowledge had made them stupid. Then, Cheng Dalei reassured Gao, urging him not to be saddened by the situation. He emphasized that the time to get even would come when the opportunity presented itself. Gao responded that he was too hungry to feel sad anymore and asked Cheng Dalei how much food he had brought back. Cheng Dalei, rubbing his head due to a headache, simply responded that he had brought 500,000 pounds. Gao, overwhelmed with disbelief, questioned whether Cheng Dalei was joking or not. Irritable, Cheng Dalei responded that he had no time to fool around explaining that two ships had transported it. Overwhelmed by the news, Gao couldn't contain his excitement and screamed that Cheng Dalei had indeed brought a million pounds of grains. However, Cheng Dalei cautioned against celebrating just yet, emphasizing the importance of safely transporting the food back to the mountain. With enthusiasm, Gao reassured Cheng Dalei that he would personally carry the grain back to the mountain, even if it meant shouldering the load himself to ensure not a single grain would be dropped on the ground. After that moment, the bandits swiftly began unloading the grains from the ship, aware of the urgency to transport them back to the fortress before dawn. The urgency stemmed from the potential consequences if the news leaked. Thousands of people and hundreds of horses were on the way from King New Mountain, and yet they had to go back and forth at least twice. As long as you could breathe, you needed the wood to be made into sleds on the spot, when the horses could no longer pull it along. The old, the weak, the women, and the children, people the horses, they all carried and pulled. But each person seemed to have inexhaustible power. They started immediately after taking the hundred-pound bags. There was occasional laughter during the busy work. Even children had to carry a bag of grain and rice on their shoulders. In a line stretching several hundred meters, they formed a lifeline, a symbol of continuous hope as it slowly dawned. As the bandits made their way back to King New Mountain with the grains, they encountered a group of people waiting for them. One of the individuals, armed with a spear, questioned Mao about what they were carrying. Mao explained that it was the food brought back by Cheng Dalei. He recognized the man who was Husey and expressed surprise that he was still alive. 
Bao advised Huzi to seek forgiveness from Cheng Dalei, noting that he was known for his soft-heartedness and thought that they would surely forgive him. Huzi, however, remained defiant, stating that he had left when the food supply was cut off, and now that there was food in the village, he questioned Mao how Cheng Dalei would forgive him. He believed that taking one or two bags of grain wouldn't make a significant difference. He demanded that Mao give him the grain. Frustrated, Mao refused to give in, asserting that everyone needed to survive the winter, and he couldn't allow Husey to take even a grain of rice. Growing desperate, Husey argued that they would starve if they didn't receive the food. Threatening to take it by force, he prepared to attack. In a swift and decisive move, Cheng Dalei, without hesitation, intervened, cutting down the individuals attempting to rob them. Husey's companions grew nervous, calling out his name in alarm. Cheng Dalei, firm and resolute, demanded action from his comrades. He ordered them to kill anyone who dared to rob them, showing no mercy. The bodies of four individuals lay on the ground as evidence of his swift actions. Aware of the urgency to proceed, Cheng Dalei urged his group to move quickly, singling out Fei Bao and eliminating the remaining companions of Huzi, ensuring their safety. Fear points accumulated for Cheng Dalei as the intense situation unfolded, causing a beep of fear points he achieved. Cheng Dalei received 91,135 fear points as of now. Gao, displaying his loyalty, warned anyone else who dared to step forward that they would meet the same fate. After dozens of miles, they finally transported all the food back to the village within a day. The people marveled at the sight of the abundance of food. They expressed their joy, remarking that they had never seen so much grain in their lives. Cheng Dalei called for everyone's attention and declared that no one was allowed to touch the grain anymore. As the bandits celebrated outside, cooking and enjoying themselves, the people ate heartily and found happiness in their newfound abundance. Even the women were delighted with their current circumstances. Cheng Dalei stood apart, observing his people as they enjoyed their meal and the company of one another. Sipping on his drink, he found himself approached by the system spirit, which materialized behind him. Suddenly, the system appeared and called Cheng Dalei, telling him that he seemed happy. While Cheng Dalei turned his gaze towards the system spirit and invited the system to try their village cuisine, showing his hospitality. Curious about Cheng Dalei's chosen path, the system questioned why he hadn't seized the opportunity to dominate King New Mountain, as it was the fastest way that cost the least. In response, Cheng Dalei emphasized that there was always something to do. But for peace of mind, it was best not to dwell too much on the future. The system spirit burst into laughter, expressing delight at Cheng Dalei's wise words. It congratulated him for successfully completing his mission and assured him that he would receive his reward. Cheng Dalei received a level 3 construction blueprint for his village. As Cheng Dalei examined the new construction drawing he had received, he thought to himself that, unlike the defensive drawings he had received previously, this one was a complete construction drawing. It included designs for various structures such as village walls, dwellings, a gathering hall, a beacon, a fortress, a fortress bunker, an observation deck, a cavalry training ground, an infantry drill ground, and even a small schoolyard. The drawing provided detailed specifications for materials and indicated a population of 1,000 and 1,000 acres of good land. Cheng Dalei, trying to comprehend the scale and requirements, wondered if he would need to purchase slaves once again to fulfill the population requirement. As he pondered the requirements for the construction, Gao and White Wolf approached him. They knelt before him in a gesture of respect. Cheng Dalei looked at them with confusion, questioning what they were doing. White Wolf told him that several of them had discussed it, while Gao spoke up, expressing their admiration for Cheng Dalei's righteousness and stating that their lives now belonged to him. He mentioned that the people of Mount King Nu would honor Cheng Dalei from that point forward. Confused by their intentions, Cheng Dalei questioned whether they had tried to join the Toad Village. The system spirit reacted with excitement upon hearing the news. Cheng Dalei suspected that the system might have interfered in some way, but the innocent smiling system denied his suspicion. In his thoughts, Cheng Dalei acknowledged the challenges of leading the 5,000 mountain bandits, half of whom were old, weak, women, and children, with only around 2,000 capable of fighting. He realized that feeding 5,000 would not be an easy task, but with the village's upgrade and increased level, he would have the strength to face formidable opponents like Hulei again. He contemplated whether he should take a step forward and make a decision. Standing up from the kneeling bandits, Cheng Dalei raised his cup in acknowledgement of everyone's words, mentioning what the most important thing was when doing business. He paused for a moment before speaking again, 
with determination. Cheng Dalei emphasized the importance of righteousness, expressing his strong conviction on the matter. Cheng Dalei declared that from that day forward, they were a united family, assuring them that no one would go hungry as long as he had food. The bandits joined in the celebration, enthusiastically cheering in agreement. As they gathered in the meeting room, a person cleared their throat and addressed the crowd, acknowledging their high regard for Cheng Dalei. They announced that Cheng Dalei reluctantly assumed the position of leader as the chief of King New Mountain. They vowed to follow Cheng Dalei's command, willingly going west or east as instructed. A person emphasized that anyone who disobeyed Cheng Dalei would also be disobeying him. Gao mentioned that they had many villages together and suggested asking their friend from the business world to give them a witness. Intrigued by the idea, Cheng Dalei asked who the Greenwood heroes were outside of King New Mountain. Gao mentioned Chief Du from the Fallen Leaves City, but he's gone. Cheng Dalei cut him off, stating that he had the one who got rid of him and continued to ask about the available options. Gao mentioned various individuals, including Zhu Gu and Zhu Xu, the solo travelers, the father and son from the Ma family involved in fishing, and the formidable Black Whirlwind from Fuhu Mountain. Cheng Dalei questioned if the Black Whirlwind mentioned was Lai Kui, but Gao clarified that his last name is Sun. Seemingly content with their current situation, Cheng Dalei made the decision not to invite any outside allies so they just had to close their door and enjoy their little life there. Cheng Dalei, shifting the topic, informed Gao that he wanted to discuss building a new village in a different location. Gao expressed his concern, questioning the need to tear down and rebuild, if that was really necessary, asking if their current situation was not doing well. White Wolf chimed in, suggesting that they could all move to the Toad Village instead, while another person beside her noted that the Toad Village was too small. Cheng Dalei mentioned if everyone fought only for themselves, stating that one would only lead to loss, but together as a united force, they could go far. He then instructed everyone to go back to make the preparations while he personally went to assess the terrain for the new village. He entrusted someone with taking care of something. In the following days, Cheng Dalei, along with Lin Xiaoyu and Zhu Shenji, explored the entirety of King New Mountain. Shenji asked Cheng Dalei what he was looking for, suggesting that Apricot Hill could be a good place. Cheng Dalei explained the specific criteria for the new village location, emphasizing the need for water, defensibility, security, and convenient transportation. He also mentioned the importance of finding ample agricultural fields, highlighting that the existing villages did not meet these requirements. Shenji expressed concern about the snowy conditions on the mountain and suggested going back. However, Cheng Dalei insisted on moving forward, stating that they were not going back but rather heading forward. As they reached the cliff, Shenji's eyes widened in awe, asking if that was the bull's horn peak, as they continued their journey up the hill. Shenji remarked that it was not only the highest point in the range but also in the entire King New Mountains. Cheng Dalei signaled to proceed to check it out. The entire King New Mountain resembled a reclining buffalo with its horns pointing east and its tail pointing west as a river slowly flowed past the bull. Observing the surroundings, Shenji noted that the wind blew from the east, providing a refreshing breeze. He mentioned that facing south towards the capital with all four hooves in the water, one could enjoy the pleasant wind and fresh air. Impressed by the scenic beauty of Mount King Nu, Shenji expressed his admiration. Xiao Yu, taken aback by Shenji's appreciation for the landscape, voiced his surprise and questioned Shenji's sense of a good landscape. In response, Shenji humbly mentioned that he had a bit of understanding. Cheng Dalei proudly declared that they had found the perfect location for their new village. He pointed to a gourd-shaped valley with a wide plain in the middle and a river running through the mountains below, emphasizing that was where they were going. Observing the landscape, Shenji remarked that the wind came from the east and the clouds appeared to look calm, giving the impression that they needed to be stirred to move. He agreed that it was indeed a favorable place. However, Shenji raised a concern, stating that they couldn't build a village, which Cheng Dalei questioned him about. Shenji then pointed out that due to a current drought, there had not been much water in the river. He voiced his anticipation that the water situation in the valley might change in the coming year, with the possibility of flooding during the melting of snow and rainfall. Cheng Dalei acknowledged the concern but assured that it could be addressed by digging a deeper river ditch to allow excess water to drain away forming a protective ditch outside the valley. They agreed to return and made the necessary preparations to complete the construction before spring. As they returned to the village, the group discussed the plan and construction was in full swing. First, they cut roads through the forest and created fire breaks. Then they threw fire into the valley, which burned for 10 days and 10 nights, turning the forest into ashes. The animals in the valley were frantically driven out by smoking fire. 
Everyone waited at the entrance of the valley and actually caught a tiger. It was the first time Cheng Dale had ever tasted tiger meat. Enjoying, Gao suggested that Cheng Dale should try the tiger tail, claiming it to be a great tonic. Cheng Dale reluctantly tasted it and agreed that it was not very tasty. In his thoughts, he found it awful and felt like he was going to vomit. Huang Sun Yuan came in handy again at this time, serving as the chief commander. Under his command, buildings were erected one after another, a medical center, a granary, an arsenal, and housing. The materials needed were taken from houses of other villages, and when 5,000 people worked on it, the project progressed very quickly. The system seemed to have fallen asleep when construction of the village began for another new evolution. In the blink of an eye, more than a month has now passed. The construction of the village was stopped by a cold snap and Cheng Dale's fear points were going up every day, and it exceeded 100,000 that day. Cheng Dale's thoughts urged to draw 10 times in a row with his accumulated 100,000 fear points, feeling that it would somehow complete his life. He checked his mission and muttered to summon a character. As he summoned characters, accompanied by multiple beeping sounds, he received a bad hunter, a normal ranger, another bad hunter, a normal farmer, and an excellent blacksmith. However, his face turned shocked and he felt a sense of disappointment as the last character revealed itself. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale stumbled upon the concept of the guaranteed minimum. He regretted his decision and found the situation ridiculous. Frustrated, Cheng Dale couldn't contain himself. He let out a loud scream at the cliff, ridiculing the situation, and catching the attention of Gao and Gao Fei Bao who were nearby. Gao, concerned, asked what was wrong with Cheng Dale. Gao Feibao, on the other hand, made a humorous comment, asking if Cheng Dale was constipated. On a peaceful day in the Toad Village, a man approached Cheng Dale with news of a group of migrants who wanted to join their village. Cheng Dale listened attentively and inquired, asking if there was a blacksmith among them. If so, he asked them to bring the blacksmith to him. Inside Cheng Dale's room, he was immersed in reading numerous papers when another person approached him. Looking up, Cheng Dale acknowledged their presence. The person introduced herself as Zhu Yu, a blacksmith. She wondered what Cheng Dale could possibly want from a blacksmith like her. Cheng Dale's thoughts raced as he realized she was a rare hidden NPC. Curiosity was piqued, he mentioned that he knew her master, blacksmith Niu from Magia Village. Zhu Yu expressed surprise, wanting to know more about her master. Cheng Dale explained that he hadn't heard from the blacksmith and said that he had her master forge a weapon. Just wanted to inquire about it. He placed his weapon on the table, stating that he got the haunted axe by chance. He expressed his belief that the blacksmith who could forge such a divine weapon must not be an ordinary person. Cheng Dale expressed his uncertainty about whether he would have the opportunity to meet the blacksmith in the future. Zhu Yu confirmed that the axe was indeed crafted by her master for the descendants of General Baokai but was lost after the owner was killed in an attack. She expressed her disbelief upon seeing the weapon. Intrigued, Cheng Dale asked if the axe possessed any unusual attributes. Zhu Yu explained that it combined special martial art techniques to unleash its true power. Otherwise, it was just a heavy piece of ordinary iron. Cheng Dale reflected on how Hu Lei, who had wielded the axe, couldn't match Xi Long's strength, and he himself was completely unable to use the skills of the axe. Changing the subject, Cheng Dale presented a sword to Zhu Yu and asked about its origin. Zhu Yu closely examined the weapon, noting that it was not an ordinary weapon. She measured its unique features and identified it as a remarkable weapon, mentioning the starburst steel handle, calcined blade made from Tian Mountain iron, and the intricately designed scabbard with a cloud pattern. She concluded that it was a truly good weapon. Curious, Cheng Dale asked Zhu Yu if she knew who the sword belonged to or what it represented. In response to Cheng Dale's question, Zhu Yu stated that based on her observation, the sword resembled the common man's sword from the 14 swords of Tian Mountain. However, she expressed surprise that it belonged to the sixth prince and shouldn't have been lost there. She slightly opened the swords and continued her analysis, noting that while there were limitations compared to the sword of the Son of Heaven, it was rare to come across such an exact imitation. Intrigued, Zhu Yu expressed her uncertainty about how Cheng Dale obtained the sword but reassured him that there shouldn't be any problem because not a lot of people knew about the sword. Interest grew as Cheng Dale mentioned the significance of the sword and the sixth prince. Cheng Dale expressed his interest in showing Zhu Yu a design plan for a giant crossbow, asking her if she was able to replicate it. She was puzzled by his request, and he clarified that he wanted her to build defense buildings and fortifications based on the blueprint. Zhu Yu assured Cheng Dale that with a group of skilled craftsmen, it would not be much of a problem. Cheng Dale entrusted her and San Yuan with the responsibility of city fortifications. 
He then instructed San Yuan to accompany Zhu Yu to their new smithy. A few days later, in Tiger Village, Cheng Dale was talking to Gao and Gao Fei Bao. Curiosity peaked, Cheng Dale asked them for their last names. They introduced themselves as Kai Dekiang and Kai Dedong, both from Yuzhu, and respectfully bowed to Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale's thoughts wandered as he wondered when Gao Fei who was in charge of King New Mountain, asking when the young man became the new one. Deking explained that they were sent by the King of Yuzhu to visit the heroes of King New Mountain. Cheng Dale, trying to keep the conversation light, asked if Deking's brother's name was Kai Delong. Surprised by the accuracy of Cheng Dale's guess, Deking inquired about Cheng Dale's knowledge of his brother. Cheng Dale chuckled and claimed it was a mere guess, expressing his admiration for the renowned reputation of the King of Yuzhu. Intrigued by their unexpected visit, he then questioned why the Lord of Yuzhu had thought of the mountain bandits this time. Deking expressed his admiration for Cheng Dale's modesty and emphasized that it was a great honor for the Lord to mention the heroes of King New Mountain. He revealed that the Lord had personally written a letter and instructed Deking to deliver it to the head of Mount King New. Deking then discussed the current threat posed by the Ring tribe, who had been invading the borders, committing acts of pillaging, murder, and plunder, and had become increasingly aggressive in recent years. He noted that they were wild but still people in their kingdom. Recognizing the skills and abilities of Cheng Dale and his men, Deking suggested that they join the military service to serve the country. In a serious tone, Cheng Dale inquired about the meaning behind the Lord's intentions, looking for recruitment. Deking explained that despite the kingdom's existence for 120 years, the Ring tribe perceived them as weak and vulnerable. Cheng Dale inwardly scoffed at the notion of them being held down and beaten for decades. Deking's words highlighted the 90,000 miles of rivers and mountains, but all men should join the military and defend the country with their bodies. He then expressed that their lord exclusively sought talented people to serve in high positions and reassured Cheng Dale that if he accepted the recruitment, he would have the opportunity to become a general and lead future generations. Cheng Dale pretended to be moved by De Kang's words and expressed his desire to protect the country. De Kang, sensing Cheng Dale's enthusiasm, questioned whether Cheng Dale was indeed saying yes. However, Cheng Dale expressed his intention to request time to discuss the matter with the other villagers. He assured the general that he would provide guidance to those who might not be well informed, offering good advice. De Kang agreed, informing Cheng Dale that in 10 days, all the heroes from the mountains in the Yuzhu area would gather outside the city at the Fengyu Pavilion, and Cheng Dale should attend. Showing a forced smile, Cheng Dale expressed his eagerness for the upcoming gathering. He then offered to see off General Kai, but the general declined the offer, indicating that there was no need for any further trouble. Cheng Dale insisted on seeing off General Kai and his brother, emphasizing that it was a must for him. With Gao and Gao Fei Bao accompanying him, they escorted the Kai siblings out of the Flying Tiger Village. As they departed, Cheng Dale waved goodbye to them, showing a friendly gesture. After a few minutes, Deking asked Dedong if they had still been watched from behind, to which Dedong confirmed. Deking then expressed his suspicion about Cheng Dale's mental state, questioning if he had been mentally ill. As the shadows of the two siblings faded into the distance, Cheng Dale expressed disappointment as he lamented not having had the strength to turn the situation around. Gao informed Cheng Dale that De Qing and Dedong had gone, prompting Gao Fei Bao to question whether they should have accepted the recruitment, to which Cheng Dale sighed heavily, stating that war had been imminent. Gao pondered the possibility of war with the Ring tribe and questioned Liu's audacity to have initiated an attack after so many years. Correcting Gao's assumption, Cheng Dale stated that it had not been about fighting the Ring tribe, but rather about confronting Black Rock City. Gao expressed curiosity about Black Rock City, prompting Cheng Dale to explain its strategic importance. He emphasized that the King New Mountain had been the only official road from Yuzhu to Black Rock City, stating that in other places the geography had been extremely complex and not suitable for large marches. Cheng Dale affirmed that if Liu had wanted to wage war on Black Rock City, he would have had to find a way to eliminate their presence. Gao Fei Bao repeated his earlier question inquiring about their acceptance of the recruitment offer. Cheng Dale cursed and dismissed the idea of accepting the recruitment, stating that it had been impossible in their lifetime. He believed that if they had been recruited, they would have been sent to fight Black Rock City, which would have only benefited Yuju, likening it to a snipe and clam locked in a fight where the fisherman would have been the ultimate winner. Gao suggested not going to the meeting at Fengyu Pavilion and outright rejecting the recruitment. But Cheng Dale disagreed, saying that they should still attend the meeting at Fengyu Pavilion. 
he saw it as an opportunity to observe others in similar situations. He explained that if they had rejected the offer directly, they would have become immediate targets. Cheng Dalei then tore apart the recruitment paper and scattered it in the wind. He expressed his concern about opposing the Lord of Yuzhu, emphasizing that they had still been in the process of recovering. As Cheng Dalei scattered all the torn paper, Gao asked about their next course of action, to which Cheng Dalei replied that they should focus on their work and quickly build the village before spring. The scene transitioned to ten days later at Feng Yu Pavilion. In Yuzhu City, inside the city lord's palace, a man sat solemnly among the gravestones, addressing his fallen comrades. He spoke to Han, expressing his sorrow over the loss of their mutual friends who had all served in the same battalion. Reflecting on their past, he mentioned Chang Feng as the first to die, emphasizing their status as mere pawns at that time. Sighing, he mentioned that he had become a higher-ranking officer and had more soldiers under his command, but fewer buddies around him. The man also mentioned taking care of Luo's son, acknowledging the son's lack of talent and arrogance but promising to raise him well. He expressed playful comments to his fallen comrade, Han, stating that he had envied him for having the man's company in death, and expressing his sadness that if he passed away, no one would accompany him. With determination, he vowed to take the enemy's head and pay homage to Han at their graves. As he drank a cup of wine and shattered it, he declared that he would join them one day, asking them to wait for him. The man was revealed as the Lord of Yushu, named Longing, as he walked outside the gravestone solemnly. Dekeng informed Lord Longting that the message had been sent to gather the bandits in Yuzhu City at the Rain and Wind Pavilion. Dekeng expressed concern about accepting these troublemakers, fearing it would tarnish Lord Longting's reputation. Lord Longting dismissed the concern, stating that even garbage could be useful if properly utilized. He acknowledged the rampant banditry in Yuzhu and saw them as a means to sharpen his forces. He mentioned King New Mountain, but Dekeng cut his words before he could finish talking. Deking mentioned that he had been on King New Mountain and told Lord Longting that Cheng Dalei, the current master, seemed willing to serve him. Lord Longting considered Cheng Dalei a wallflower, recognized his ability to get things done, and expressed that if he proved to be useful, he could be given a task. However, if the bandits failed to make any progress, Lord Longting instructed Deking to find a reason to eliminate them all. Lord Longting decided not to attend the Rain and Wind Pavilion personally, and left the task to Deking. Dekeng, showing his loyalty, responded affirmatively to Lord Longting's instructions, bowing in agreement. At that moment, a man suddenly arrived, calling Lord Longting his adoptive father. He suggested wiping out the bandits instead of bothering with them. With clenched teeth, the man proposed taking 500 soldiers and horses to exterminate the bandits within a month to save Lord Longting the trouble. The man introduced himself as Luo Tai, Yang Longting's adopted son. However, Lord Longting ordered DeLong to take Luo Tai away and keep him away from the rain and wind pavilion, to which DeLong responded attentively. DeLong and Deking dragged Luo Tai away as he desperately called out to his Lord Longting, wanting to prove himself. Somewhere in Yuzhu City, two lifeless women's bodies lay on the ground, and a masked person stood up to a woman who had been tied up, warning her not to scream and instructing her to call her parents, with the intention to kill them, relishing the idea of her sorrow. He spoke of his desire that if he went to Yang's place, he would become a general and marry numerous concubines. He paused for a minute, showing his evil eyes before emphasizing his intention to make that woman his first concubine. The masked man was introduced as Dan Fei and then leaped away from the balcony, disappearing through the roof as he laughed maniacally with evil and twisted delight. On the desolate wild man's shore, a person spoke to Koji that his frostbite hadn't healed yet. Concerned about the severity of the condition, which could ruin his legs. The man mentioned a deal made half a month ago, where they had killed a woman and a child but allowed a man to escape, realizing that they could have earned more money for it. Despite their remorse, they acknowledged that by joining Yang's recruitment, even if they suspected his evil intentions, at least they got a bit to eat. Meanwhile, in the Black Bear village of Fuhu Mountain, a large man lay sleeping alongside a bear. Suddenly, he woke up and let out a wide yawn perhaps indicating a sense of weariness or the need for rest. Somewhere in the eerie silence of an abandoned cemetery, setting the stage for a foreboding atmosphere. With just a single message from the Lord of Yuzhu, many demons in the forest of Yuzhu woke up. In the midst of a snowy mountain landscape, the old man spoke, mentioning that the ninth day of the month was unfavorable for various activities, and he cautioned against traveling far, meeting with guests, and making any significant moves. The kid stated that nothing seemed appropriate at the moment. He then asked the old man if they were still going to the rain and wind pavilion. 
the old man responded with a cryptic answer, emphasizing the importance of various factors such as distance, heaven, destiny, and humans are important, stating that heaven was not benevolent, and the path on his own feet he had to walk himself, interrupting the old man's train of thought. The kid expressed their concern about their current situation and mentioned that they hadn't eaten anything for two days, which confirmed it. Continuing the conversation, the kid asked why the Lord of Yuzhu had recruited the savages and bandits and chosen the Rain and Wind Pavilion as the location. The old man admitted his lack of knowledge but warned that they should remain cautious. He speculated that the Lord might exploit the recruitment as an opportunity to eliminate everyone. The old man explained that the pavilion's openness provided little opportunity for an ambush, reflecting the Lord's desire to convey a sense of sincerity. The kid questioned whether they were going to the pavilion to secure two days' worth of meals, prompting the old man to admit. He asked the kid what the most important thing in the world was. In response, the kid's answer was to act fast. The old man further asked about one of the 36 rules, and the kid answered that if all else failed, they should retreat. Impressed by the child's cleverness, the old man praised his quick thinking. With their discussion concluded, the old man determined that they should proceed. The place was set in the rain and wind pavilion where a gathering of all kinds of heroes from different places met in there. The bandits gathered at the rain and pavilion, discussing how the people who had come were all well-known figures. They then exchanged greetings as they recognized one another. A man was confused as to why Yang Longting had only prepared a few seats when there were so many people expected. Another man explained that there were only a few seats because the master sat in the center and the left side was at the top, while the right side was at the bottom. The man went on to say that anyone who dared to sit in the center was daring to occupy the highest position as a bandit. The brothers Guo and Shu then believed they had a right to the seats. An unknown man chimed in, noticing that the two graveyard rats were also making a splash that day, which made the people wonder who the man was. Dan Fei arrived and was mocked by the brothers who recognized him and asked him why he was so miserable. Dan Fei then suggested that if they wanted to be considered for the position, they should approach him first. One of the brothers told Dan Fei that the boss bear sat first in the forest, however, he was still far from second. Dan Fei took a step forward and suggested that if they weren't convinced, they could settle it with swords, and that he would take the second position in the forest as he ran towards the seat. They were caught off guard and attempted to pursue Dan Fei, ordered him to stop and asked him what else he could do besides running fast. Dan Fei then retorted that if they didn't run, anyone could beat them. A man and a boy arrived at the rain and pavilion, mumbling that the three emperors and five emperors of antiquity were the best in terms of morality, while the Zia, Shang, and Zhu dynasties were the best in terms of merit. He went on to say that for many years, the seven heroes of the warring states and the five hegemons of the spring and autumn periods had been in strife and had undergone rise and fall and change in a short period of time. The old man then asked the boy what the most important thing in the world was, to which the boy answered that it was peace. The bandits noticed the two and recognized them, asking the old man what he had to say. The old man informed them that they were all allies from the forest who had gathered and asked them if he could help determine their position, assuring them that he would be fair. Somewhere at the top of a cliff, Yan Longting and his advisor watched the bandits from a distance. The man asked Yan Longting what the reason was for fighting over a few chairs as they were only a bunch of troublemakers. Yan Longting explained that if he thought the bandits were fighting for status, as there was no first place in literature and no second in martial arts, they fought over every centimeter when a group of wild people got together. Wai Shanyan, the military strategist of Yang Longting, asked him if he wanted him to take charge as he was afraid chaos would arise. Yang Longting then told Lai Shanyan that there was no need for it because he just had to let them fight and didn't care if a few of the bandits died because all he wanted to know was who would become the leader of the bandits under his jurisdiction. He went on to say that they were poachers from the forest, however, he believed that there were also exceptional people. But unfortunately, they were not useful to him. One of the bandits asked the fortune teller which one of them would take the second chair as it was clear to them that the first chair was for the boss bear of Fuhu. Another bandit said that they didn't want to compete with the boss bear for the first chair so he could tell them about the second place. The fortune teller asked them about their achievements that they had made in the forest, and in that way, he would know who could be ranked second in the forest of Yuzhu. He then pointed to the two brothers, telling them that their mother died too soon for some reason, and that after the funeral, they were discovered by grave robbers. They also grew up to be grave robbers who robbed people's graves. The fortune teller called out the Ma family from the wild man's shore, telling them that they liked to rob on waterways. However, their real hobby was slaughtering the whole family. 
and as for Liu, the fortune teller asked him if he wasn't afraid of being held down and beaten to the ground. A man told the fortune teller that he didn't need to speak nonsense because he should have just told them who should sit in the second chair, and that if he said anything wrong, he would have cut his neck. The fortune teller then informed them that as for the second seat according to the ancient Tao, they did not deserve to sit as there was one person in the Yuzhu forest who deserved it. The people asked who it was as they noticed Gao Fei Hu and some others were coming. They greeted Gao Fei Hu, and a man approached him, saying that the last time he had been a guest in the tiger village, he didn't have enough wine, while another man chimed in, saying that he had been thinking about doing a deal with him and asking him if he was interested. Zhu Shenji informed Cheng Dale that they needed to find shelter because the winds were strong. Cheng Dale noticed the chairs, looked around, and sat down, mumbling that he had been riding for so long that his feet were numb. The bandits were then alerted, and Dan Fei asked Cheng Dale if he wanted to die. He pointed his knife towards Cheng Dale and questioned him if he was worthy to sit in the position as the chief of the bandits. Dan Fei threatened Cheng Dale to get down and grovel or she would let him taste her knife. Cheng Dale asked if she was Dan Fei, the famous lady hunter, to which Dan Fei threatened him more to get off. Cheng Dale giggled and called Kin Man, ordering him to slaughter Dan Fei for him. Kin Man sprang towards Dan Fei, who had been thrown to the ground and coughed a mouthful of blood. Dan Fei then believed that she had to run as Kin Man was unbeatable. She flipped and ran as Kin Man was standing behind her. Kin Man unsheathed his spear, stared intently at the running Dan Fei, and threw his spear at her. Dan Fei was struck, bled, and died, and the people who saw what happened wondered where Cheng Dale and company had come from. Cheng Dale laughed and murmured that it was much quieter at the moment than it had been earlier. The fortune teller mumbled while sitting and eating that the few lines of names in history books had created countless burial mounds, and that the subsequent generations had seen the foundations created by earlier dynasties taken over by later generations, while the parties themselves thought they were engaged in a tiger fight. He then asked him if he was Cheng Dale of the Toad Village. Cheng Dale asked the fortune teller what his name was, to which the old man answered that his last name was Guo. Cheng Dale took a guess that his name was Guo Jedang. Guo suggested that he should just call him Mr. Beidu as his real name was pretty annoying. Cheng Dale told Mr. Beidu that he was mysterious because he thought it was not his real name. Mr. Beidu mused, telling Cheng Dale that he was just a regular old guy who had nothing to hide. The system then popped up notifying Cheng Dale that the old man's name was Annoying Guy Guo, and his nickname was Mr. Beidu, age 75, and had a skill that could see through the world. Cheng Dale thought that it was another inscrutable person, exactly the same as Lai Zingzai, as he believed that the system couldn't see through every person. He responded to Mr. Beidu that he was just joking. The bandits realized that it was the devil of the King Niu Mountain, while others said that they heard a rumor that Du Mao was killed by Cheng Dale, and that he had also burned Black Rock City and slaughtered people, while the others saw him as an ordinary person. A bear roar alerted the people that Boss Bear was on his way. A huge man riding a bear arrived and the system informed Cheng Dale that the man was named Sun Du and was nicknamed Black Whirlwind, age 38, and the master of the Fuhu Mountain. Each bandit greeted Sun Du with respect, telling him that he had recently lost weight, and would appreciate it if he could give him some ginseng to use as a tonic. The other bandit introduced himself as Haiwa and asked Sun Du if he remembered him. Sweating, Cheng Dale wondered if Sun Du was the boss bear and was amazed by the bear he rode. Cheng Dale's eyes shone as he wondered how someone could tame a black bear as a mount and was captivated by the appearance of Sun Du. Stuttering, one of the brothers informed Sun Du that one of the seats at the Wind and Rain Pavilion was occupied by Cheng Dale. Sun Du stared intently and stood up on his bear mount and leaped towards where Cheng Dale was sitting. Sun Du stared down at Cheng Dale and leaned closer to him, threatening him to get lost. Cheng Dale stared back and informed Sun Du that he had an eye booger. Sun Du gritted his teeth and scoffed and proceeded to laugh hysterically. Cheng Dale then mocked him, saying that his laugh sounded worse than crying. Sun Du raised his axe and was about to hit Cheng Dale, telling him to die. Kin Man intercepted Sun Du's axe and parried it, making Sun Du praise him as he had been able to block a blow from him. Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man to block another of Sun Du's attacks as he would summon the thunder to kill him. Sun Du yelled at him, asking Cheng Dale if he still wanted to harm him. Cheng Dale raised both of his hands and told Sun Du to look at the thunder in the sky. With a grim expression, Sun Du stepped back, readying himself for Cheng Dale's attack. However, there was no thunder that struck, leaving them completely speechless. Gao Fei Hu and the bandits murmured when Cheng Dale started to laugh like crazy, asking Kin Man if he had seen their expressions. He then mumbled that Sun Du was really stupid. Enraged, Sun Du threatened Cheng Dale that he would rip him apart. 
General Kai arrived, asking for Sun Du and Cheng Dale to wait as he advised them not to do it as it would violate the peace between the two sides. He then informed Cheng Dale and Sun Du that Yang Longting had recently caught a cold and that he would be hosting the event. However, Yang Longting was watching them from a distance, so he requested them to mind their manners. Sun Du scoffed and told Cheng Dale that if it hadn't been for General Kai, he would have chopped him up. Cheng Dale mocked him sarcastically, telling him that he was scared. General Kai told them that as long as they promised to listen to Yang Longting's commands and forget all the deeds of the past, there would be a great future for them that would assure their families. Cheng Dale and Mr. Beidu yelled patriotic statements for their country as they celebrated the good news. They both stared expressionlessly at each other and shook hands after having the thought that they could be friends for a long time. Cheng Dale then informed General Kai that for a long time he had desired to serve the realm and that since his youth he had read wise books and thought about doing something for the country and the people, which made General Kai uncomfortable. He went on to say that if he could, he would have loved to rip his heart out and show General Kai how hot it was. General Kai told Cheng Dale that there was no need for him to get excited at their recruitment at the time and that Yan Longting was ready to form an army of heroes and from the two of them, a general would be chosen. Cheng Dale claimed that he had accepted the official position of general and would keep his promise. Surprised, General Kai told Cheng Dale that he hadn't said that he was the one who was chosen. Cheng Dale held General Kai and convinced him that if he still didn't believe him, he would show him his heart. Sun Du questioned him if he was worthy of it. General Kai then told them not to hurry to argue as at the moment they wanted to leave behind not only the past of the bandits but also weapons and equipment, assuring them of Yang Longting's sincerity. While Yang Longting was watching them, he told Lai Shanyan that he found the bandits amusing because they were so excited about getting a few benefits. Lai Shanyan claimed that the one from King Niu Mountain was reasonably disciplined. However, he couldn't say the same for Sun Du. Yang Longton ordered him to keep testing the bandits and provoke them a little, as he was fine with a few more deaths. His gaze was disrupted as Luo Tai arrived, humiliating the bandits and asking them if they still called themselves humans. Sweating, General Kai was puzzled and asked Luo Tai why he had come, and Luo Tai answered that he was helping him with his work. Yang Longting was angry, telling Lai Shanyan to bring Luo Tai back. General Kai asked Luo Tai not to make trouble for him and to go back. Luo Tai responded that he wouldn't cause problems and that he would show the whole country with his sword. He then told the bandits that as long as they won against his swift sword in his hand, they could stay or do as they wished. Cheng Dale asked Luo Tai how fast his swift sword was. Luo Tai tossed some coins and told Cheng Dale that it was very fast. He focused on the coins, took a swinging stance with his sword, and swung, cutting the coins in half. He smirked and sheathed his sword, and the system informed Cheng Dale that the man's name was Luo Tai, and he was 25 years old and a top swordsman. The bandits were in awe after Luo Tai cut with three cuts in one sword, believing that he was indeed powerful. Luo Tai laughed and told the bandits that even if one of them could cut three copper coins, he would let them go. Cheng Dale was unimpressed and informed Gao Fei Hu that they were leaving, to which Gao Fei Hu responded by asking him if he didn't want to watch the show. Cheng Dale then asked him what he wanted him to watch because it wasn't a sideshow, and the wind was starting to get tighter. General Kai asked Cheng Dale why he wanted to leave. Cheng Dale responded that he still had some work to do in the village and assured General Kai that his heart would always belong to Yang Longting, and that if given an order, he would not hesitate to walk through the fire. General Kai and Luo Tai agreed with Cheng Dale, telling him that he had a good point while a strange man lurked on their back. The two soldiers dragged Luo Tai which made him throw a tantrum asking them to let him go as he did his duty for Yang Longting. Cheng Dale asked General Kai who those people were and asked if he could introduce him to them. General Kai responded that they were just his fellow co-workers. He asked Cheng Dale if he was about to leave, to which Cheng Dale answered that he was going to go at the moment. Cheng Dale waved at Luo Tai and company, telling them that he had talked to General Kai about them, while Luo Tai struggled, asking the two soldiers to let go of him. Cheng Dale then told them that he had heard a lot about them and that General Kai's buddies were also his buddies, and he knew them like the back of his hand. He suggested that they pay tribute to each other, which surprised General Kai. One of the soldiers informed General Kai that they were soldiers and were incompatible with the bandits. He also reminded him that he had to think about his future and not get close to the bandits, which left General Kai speechless. Meanwhile, on their way back, Cheng Dale told them that Luo Tai seemed crazy and that he also seemed to have no regard for the people in the Yuzhu forest. Kin Man responded and told Cheng Dale that he hadn't given his order or he would have made Luo Tai's life hell. 
Cheng Dalei told him to let Luo Tai be crazy as he had nothing to do with them. Gao Fei who chimed in and informed them that Luo Tai was the adopted son of Yang Longting, who was headstrong and not willful enough to be feared. Cheng Dalei mumbled that it was hard to say that Luo Tai had some real skills and that Yang Longting was indeed surrounded by a wealth of talent, as several powerful people were claimed to be watching them at the time. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dalei if it was okay for them to leave and that Yang Longting wanted to recruit generals. He expressed concern that if they were not there, the position could be snatched away by Sun Du. Cheng Dalei responded that he had just decided to go to show his face and express his sincerity to everyone. And as for Sun Du and himself, it would be Yang Longting who would need him and give him the official post. One of them then informed Cheng Dalei that he had seen a big tree in front of them and suggested that they take shelter under the tree and eat something before they continued, to which Cheng Dalei agreed. As they were camping, they took a break and chatted for a while. Kin Man noticed someone behind them and asked who it was. A group of people appeared, armed with weapons. One of them introduced himself as Kai Dao and said that he was the second leader of Fuhu Mountain. He told Chen Dale that Sun Du had ordered them to send him to his death as they began to charge at them. Gao Fei who wondered what Sun Du meant, as they had always been at peace with Fuhu Mountain. Cheng Dale took his sword and asked Gao Fei who why he was still talking to them and also ordered his men to kill their attackers. Kin Man slashed through them, and Gao Fei who also did the same. Plenty of blood dropped towards their campfire. Later on, a man was sweating as he was threatened by a sword at his throat. The man then asked Cheng Dale to spare his life and not to kill him. Cheng Dale accepted and told the man that no one would kill him and ordered him to take Kai Dao's head back and send him a message for Sun Du. However, he set it aside and told the man that Sun Du would understand his message when he saw Kai Dao's head. The man ran, and Cheng Dale muttered that with just a few of them trying to kill him was just too childish. Kin Man suggested that they needed to go back as it was getting dark, to which Cheng Dale agreed. One of them wondered if the road they took was going for the Fallen Leaf City, and was amused by how close it was, while the other asked Cheng Dale if he was going to see Su Ying. Cheng Dale agreed and told them to go back to the village first as he would just go back by himself. Then one of them told Cheng Dale to take care. Cheng Dale told Zhu Shenji not to go as he had to go with him. After their arrival at Fallen Leaf City, Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale why he had taken him with him. Cheng Dale told him the reason was that he was resourceful, and he couldn't do what he needed to do without him. He suggested that Zhu Shenji call him Prince Apau, to which Zhu Shenji agreed and told him that he would do his job as well. Cheng Dale then asked him what he had to do. Zhu Shenji giggled and told Cheng Dale that he was going to drink flower wine. Cheng Dale let Zhu Shenji go and reminded him not to miss his task of meeting him at Su Ying's restaurant the next day, to which Zhu Shenji told him that he got it. As Zhu Shenji was leaving, Cheng Dale thought that he had run fast. However, Cheng Dale took a pouch from his pocket and mumbled about how Zhu Shenji would drink flower wine without money. Night arrived, and Cheng Dale knocked on someone's door. He placed his hand on the door and noticed that it was locked from the inside and heard someone crying. He then leaped onto the roofed gate and landed inside the house. Zioda was holding a knife, asking who the intruder was. She realized that it was Cheng Dale and asked him why he had to go over the wall instead of going through the door. Cheng Dale asked Zioda why she was crying and about Su Ying's whereabouts. Teary-eyed, Zioda informed him that Su Ying's father had died and that Su Ying wanted to pay her last respects to him. But she was kidnapped. Cheng Dale questioned her and asked her to tell him more about what had happened. Zioda explained that Su Ying's father had died three days before, and Su Ying wanted to pay her last respects to him but was thrown out several times. However, Su Ying's family was targeting their Huli restaurant's business and said that if the restaurant was not returned, she would not be allowed to say goodbye to her father. Crying, Zioda proceeded to tell Cheng Dale that in the afternoon, the Su family had called Su Ying to discuss the matter, but she didn't return. Cheng Dale patted Zioda's head and comforted her, telling her not to cry as they would go to the Su family. Zioda was worried about Cheng Dale's identity and would get arrested. Cheng Dale, however, told her that they would go. They then arrived at the Su family's household, and Zioda stood in front of the door. Zioda knocked aggressively and yelled to open the door. A man opened the door, asking what all the noise was about and if Zioda was visiting to mourn. Zioda asked Su Zhong if she had been there for Su Ying. Su Zhang yelled at her, telling her to get lost as Su Ying had left before it got dark and hadn't seen her return. Zioda retorted, telling him that she didn't believe him and that she had waited for Su Ying who hadn't come back at all. 
Su Zhang argued back, saying he didn't know and that she must have gone to find a wild man, which wouldn't be unusual for her as she had been the wife of a bandit. Zyoda was annoyed and told Su Zhang to watch his mouth, believing that Su Ying must have been locked up by them, and asked him to let her in to find out. Su Zhang slammed the door in her face, telling her to get lost as she had no discipline and asking her if the Su family was the kind of place she could enter whenever she wanted. Angry, Zyoda gritted her teeth. Cheng Dalei asked her if she was sure that it was the Su family that did it, to which Zyoda answered that Su Ying had no enemies in the city, and that there was no one else other than the Su family who had done it. She suggested to him that they go inside by climbing the wall, and find Su Ying and see what the Su family wanted to say. Cheng Dalei told her to knock again as he wanted to use the door. Zyoda knocked and yelled again to open the door and cursed at Su Zhang. She went on to say that if he fell into her hands she would spank his ass until it turned red and added more curse words. Su Zhang opened the door and yelled at Zyoda, asking her if she wanted to die. However, it wasn't Zyoda who greeted him but Cheng Dalei, who was about to attack him. Su Zhang was hit in the stomach, causing him to fall to the ground, and as Zyoda watched, Cheng Dalei asked her where she was most likely to get locked up. Zyoda told him that the Su family had a cellar where sometimes a few subordinates were locked up who had committed mistakes believing that Su Ying must have been there as well. Cheng Dalei then told her to hurry up as they would go to the cellar. Meanwhile, at the funeral, a woman was paying her respects. Lai Dato informed his little sister that they had locked Su Ying up and asked her if it really didn't matter. The woman responded that at the moment they had to keep Su Ying in the cellar for a few years, and when the wind died down, they were going to betroth her to a subordinate and that she could do anything but resign to her fate when she gave birth. Lai Dadu questioned her, saying her plan was a little harsh. The woman clenched her teeth and told him that she had been with Su Sihai since she was 18. But when he died, he left Su Ying his entire family fortune without giving her a single coin. She went on and said that in Su Sihai's eyes, she would always be his concubine, and she believed that a concubine was a slave. She asked Lai Dadu how she could tell him how much she had suffered, as if they both came from a bitter background and that her parents had sold her at the age of 13. Angry, she added that they had lived until that moment, and they should have understood that if they did not fight for what was theirs, they would get nothing. Lai Dadu reminded her that Su Ying had connections with the mountain bandits and worried if they would retaliate. The woman then told him that rumors said that even if she followed the mountain bandits, she had certainly been played with enough, and that she would have been dragged back to the mountain village, and she asked him if there were any gentle and respectful mountain bandits in the world. The woman stood up and told Lai Dadu that he could go now and ordered him to look for some physically talented people for her in the next few days and recruit them, as there were some things that she was not comfortable doing as a woman. Lai Dadu assured her that he was already working on it and had some leads. A man shouted that the bandits were coming inside, which shocked the two siblings. A group of men, the Sioux family's servants, alerted everyone that the mountain bandits were on their way while others sought assistance. They then realized that the mountain bandit was from the Toad Village, as they heard rumors that Cheng Dalei had done nothing but evil, from 8-year-old children to 99-year-olds. He had killed all kinds of people. Cheng Dalei informed them that he didn't want to kill them as they were from the Su family. With a serious gaze, Cheng Dalei ordered them to hand him over Su Ying as he didn't want to kill them. The men from the Su family were scared, causing Cheng Dalei to gain fear points. As they trembled from fear, they told each other to go first. Cheng Dalei then told Zyoda that they were going to find Su Ying first. As they were running to one of the Su family houses, Zyoda was calling for Su Ying's whereabouts. She told Cheng Dalei that they arrived at the Su family basement, believing that Su Ying must be inside. Zyoda proceeded to announce that they came to save her. Puzzled, Zyoda was confused why the basement was empty and wondered where Su Ying was. Cheng Dalei thought to himself and claimed that Su Ying was taken away as there were traces of movement on the floor. A woman appeared and called Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei turned to look at who called him, and the woman introduced herself as Su Lishi and told him that she had met him before. Agitated, Zyoda inquired of Su Lishi as to where she had hidden Su Ying, pleading with her to release her. Su Lishi ignored Zyoda and told Cheng Dalei that they were also worried about Su Ying's disappearance. However, she informed Cheng Dalei that Su Ying was not in the house as she had left at dusk. She went on to say that if Cheng Dalei didn't believe her, he could search the house, and every door of the Su family was open to him. While Cheng Dalei threatened her with a sword at her neck, he asked Su Lishi if she wasn't afraid of him killing her. With a calm expression, Su Lishi responded that she thought of him as a heroic person who would not put a weak woman in trouble. Doubtful, Cheng Dalei wondered if Su Lishi was stalling. He then sheathed his sword and as he walked, he told Zyoda that they had gone to search for Su Ying outside. 
Ziode kept calling for Su Ying around the Su family household, asking where she was. They arrived at the funeral room when Ziode told Cheng Dalei that there was no one around either and asked him what they were going to do at that time. Cheng Dalei responded that it was easy to hide one person as the Su family's property was so big. Frustrated, he mumbled, believing that Su Ying was not in the area after all, and that if they had gotten her out in such a short time, they would have been able to find her. Su Li Shi once again appeared and told Cheng Dalei that she had already informed him that Su Ying was not in the house. Smirking, she went on to ask Cheng Dalei to let her know immediately if he had any news about Su Ying as she was worried about her. Aggravated, Cheng Dalei told Ziyoda that they were going to leave. However, Ziyoda was still insistent about finding Su Ying. As they rushed to leave the Su family household, Cheng Dalei looked once again at Su Li Shi and noticed that she was smiling and glancing towards the funeral room, which surprised him. He then hurriedly turned back to where the coffin was and told Ziyoda to open the coffin. Su Li Shi's eyes grew wide, and she told Cheng Dalei that her late husband Su Sihai's bones were still cold and that the coffin must not be opened. Cheng Dalei pushed her out of his way. She fell, and Cheng Dalei forcefully opened the coffin and threw the cover away, which made a banging sound. Shocked, Cheng Dalei then mumbled that he had found Su Ying tied down and sleeping with bruises on her face. He carried her and tried to wake her up as she was unconscious. Su Ying opened her eyes and noticed Cheng Dalei seriously calling her name as she also muttered Cheng Dalei's name. She hugged him and asked if he had come to save her, to which Cheng Dalei responded that he apologized for being late. Cheng Dalei felt relieved, mumbling that he was glad that she was okay. Flustered, Su Ying thought that her mind was going blank as Cheng Dalei was holding her so tightly and warmly. And while her heart was beating so fast, she wondered what was wrong with her, as her face turned red. Her eyes twirled and she fainted, prompting Cheng Dalei to ask her why she had fainted again, assuming she had a fever. Cheng Dalei then carried Su Ying and threatened Su Li Shi that he would deal with her some other time. While Su Li Shi was kneeling on the ground, Su Li Shi stood up and watched Cheng Dalei and the rest leave, and with a grim look on her face, she mumbled the names of Cheng Dalei and Su Ying, stating that she wouldn't spare any of them. After a while, Cheng Dalei assured Su Ying that they were fine. Blushing, Su Ying responded and told Cheng Dalei that he was a good person. Then Cheng Dalei told her that she just couldn't call everyone a good person. Su Ying grabbed Cheng Dalei's coat and kissed him making Cheng Dalei blush. Cheng Dalei's eyes felt dizzy from the occurrences, and after a little while, the two of them fumed and felt hot. Su Ying distanced herself and covered her flustered face while Cheng Dalei covered his mouth out of surprise. The system notified Cheng Dalei that the fourth stage of the woman of the village had been triggered, and his mission was to assist Su Ying in reclaiming her family fortune. It then told Cheng Dalei that his victory was already in sight, and advised him to continue winning Su Ying's heart. Cheng Dalei asked Su Ying if they could do it again, but the flustered Su Ying declined and answered that she was too embarrassed. Ziyoda rushed to open the door to notify Su Ying about the bad news. Cheng Dalei and Su Ying were alerted by Ziyoda's sudden arrival. Ziyoda informed them that the soldiers had surrounded the Su family's courtyard. The soldiers were shouting to block the road with wagons as all the roads should be blocked so that not even a fly could escape from the manor, while others were giving orders to put shield soldiers in front and block the back door. Cheng Dalei opened the door and was met by an unimaginable amount of soldiers, which made him curse in his thoughts and wonder if they had to put on such a big show just to catch him. One of the soldiers yelled at Cheng Dalei, telling him not to resist as there was no way out for him. Sweating, Cheng Dalei gave them a smile and responded that he gave up, as a couple of swords were near his neck. The soldier then advised Cheng Dalei not to play tricks with them, and if he dared to move, his people would put 10,000 swords in his body while another soldier suggested to the boss soldier that they put iron handcuffs on Cheng Dalei because he had heard legends about him knowing magic spells and not let him use any of them. The boss soldier requested his men to quickly get him some chains while Cheng Dalei's face was in grave danger. The boss soldier ordered one of his men to push Cheng Dalei and assured him that he didn't need to be afraid as he was just one person, to which the soldier disagreed, scared that Cheng Dalei would use his thunder magic on him. The boss soldier retorted that he didn't need to be afraid and hurried his men to kill two black dogs as black dog blood had an effect of warding off evil spirits. Su Ying and Ziyoda were watching from far away, concerned about Cheng Dalei's situation. While being cuffed, Cheng Dalei sang a song that the sun rose in the east and the moon set in the west, and the pedestrians should thank the rooster for the fifth night, and when the rooster crowed and the day dawned, the wolves, insects, and tigers hid their tracks. He then went on and sang that sister should not worry, that there were people who walked in the dark, everyone said there were tigers on the mountain, but sister, he should take the sword. 
as Cheng Dalei continued with the lyrics, stating that sister should not worry, that there were people who walked in the dark. Everyone said there were tigers on the mountain, but there was a toad king in the mountain, which made Su Ying realize something. Cheng Dalei laughed as he yelled, Toad King, which annoyed the soldiers, and they ordered him to stop singing. While another soldier asked Cheng Dale if he still wanted to sing even if he was on the verge of death. Xiaoda asked Su Ying what they were going to do, to which Su Ying responded that they were going to the Huli Fish. After a little while at the Huiloi restaurant, Zhu Shenji had been kicked out by a man cursing at him and telling him that he was in the wrong place to fool around. Zhu Shenji retorted and mocked the man, telling him that he had to wait until he had the silver and then he would let him lick the soles of his shoes. While walking, Zhu Shenji was fuming, believing that Cheng Dale must have stolen his wallet as his wallet couldn't possibly have fallen to the ground, assuring himself that he had tied it up so tight. He then cursed Cheng Dale for going to a girl and stealing his wallet instead of forcing him to go drinking. Zhu Shenji thought about messing with Cheng Dale's mood as he had messed up with his own and wondered when he had become so good at being a thief. As he walked, he thought of Cheng Dale as a flying thief who couldn't possibly be apprehended by a soldier, however, as he passed some soldiers accompanying a criminal, he wondered why there were so many of them mobilized at night. He hid and thought about who the thief was that was powerful enough to cause such a stir in the fallen leaf city. And no matter who he was, he believed that he was unlucky. As Zhu Shenji stared at them, Cheng Dale yelled that he would come back. Zhu Shenji's eyes grew wide and his jaw dropped as he realized that it was Cheng Dale who had been held as a prisoner. Moments later, Zhu Shenji rushed towards Su Ying's restaurant and when he encountered the Liao brothers, he told them that there was bad news, Cheng Dale had been arrested by the soldiers in the city. Agitated, the Liao brothers asked Zhu Shenji what they were going to do. Zhu Shenji then told them that they must not let him fall into the hands of the soldiers as Cheng Dale had treated them well, and that their only option was to raid the prison. Su Ying and Sayoda arrived at the restaurant, telling Zhu Shenji to hold on and disagreeing with his idea that a prison raid was the worst scenario, as with the number of people they had, they would get caught easily. She asked Liao Jia to hurry to the Toad Village immediately to send a message. The next day, the soldiers ordered the civilians not to rush and warned that if they cut in line, he would pierce them with his lance. Liu Bei sighed when he was asked by one of the soldiers what he had been doing. With a gloomy look, Liu Bei responded that he had been just a shoe seller and had been having a hard time making a living. He sighed again. The soldier felt sunken as Liu Bei continued to tell him that as a person, he had been born into a rocky career and had been oppressed by some higher officials. Liu Bei kept sighing, all staring at Liu Bei as he entered the gate. The soldier wondered why there had been so many people coming into town that day. As the soldier turned around, Guan Yu and Zhao Fei were behind him, shouting that they had been selling green beans for 30 copper plates per 1 pound and 10 copper coins for 4 pounds. Kin Man and the White Wolf entered the gate next. The soldier looked at them and wondered why there had been so many people coming that day. He mumbled that he had seen two brothers selling weapons and a strong man carrying firewood, claiming that he had been handsome and had looked like a pagoda when he had stood in front of him. The soldier also noticed that there had been people who did small business and a hunter, while there had also been a nobleman with a servant girl, which he had hated as they had had some big money. He then thought that on that day everything had been the same, but he felt that something had been wrong. As a rule, not so many people would come to the city in the winter. Later that day, someone informed Zhu Shenji that among them that day there had been more than 50 people who had mingled with the locals and that the 2,000 brothers in the village had been ready and waiting for the beacon. They could enter the city at any time. Zhu Shenji responded that Cheng Dale had been willing to save his life for them to get food and that it had been the time for them to walk through fire for him if they had to. He then told them that they would break into the prison that night and free Cheng Dale. The men cheered, and Zhu Shenji ordered them to mobilize all the men as they would conquer the fallen leaves city and save Cheng Dale. Liu Bei chimed in and told them that the prison might have been heavily guarded, and even if they could save Cheng Dale, many of their men would have perished. He believed that Cheng Dale wouldn't have wanted to see something like that, and they couldn't have done it recklessly. Zhu Shenji asked Liu Bei for his suggestion. Liu Bei responded that they had to first send people to investigate the area around the prison and also send people out to protect Su Ying. He went on to believe that they had already considered all the things he had come up with. Zhu Shenji answered that he was correct and that he had been just about to send someone out for that. Liu Bei then said that the most important thing was that Cheng Dale must not be allowed to suffer in prison. He mentioned that it had been said that if you entered the prison in the fallen leaves city alive, you would come out dead. He further mentioned that inside, the 18 instruments of torture were complete, and even if you didn't die, you would suffer in agony. 
He went on to say that they needed to send some men to the city who would cause problems and end up in jail to take care of Cheng Dalei. Zhu Shenji yelled at them, stating that Liu Bei was correct and they had to get Cheng Dalei out quickly as he must have been in painful agony. After some time, a huge crowd of people attended Su Sihai's funeral. The people were gossiping that a rich family should rest the spirit for at least 77 days after death, while others wondered how the body had been sent out of the house before the first seven days. Some people told others to stop talking, while some informed them that Su Lishi was the mother-in-law of the Su family, while others showed sympathy for Su Lishi for being a widow at such a young age. As night came, Su Lishi walked through the Su family's house. She contemplated that the Su family was over and was in the bag, and that in her 36 years of life, she had never experienced such relief. She stared at the moon and continued to contemplate that when she was young and poor, her parents hadn't cared much for her, and that while other people's daughters had worn new clothes, she had only worn old ones. While others had decorated themselves with flowers, she had only tied ropes around herself and only her older brother had used his hard-earned money to buy her a piece of candy. She then believed that she had nothing except her beauty that God has given her, and that during famine at the age of 13, she was sold by her parents to human traffickers and was deflowered. And after that, she was given into the hands of several wealthy families. She seemed to look beautiful, more delicate than the March pear blossom. However, no one knew how exhausted she was inside. And at the age of 18, she fell into Su Sihai's hands, and once a concubine, she would always be a slave, even other lower servants pushed her around. And because her own body couldn't compete, she could not give birth to a male child, so she couldn't enjoy any benefits. Su Li Shi went on, saying that now that she was 36 years old, everyone in the whole Su family had to call her madam. She had tons of family wealth and a thousand hectares of land, and no one was able to compete with her. She mumbled that in 36 years of her life, she had never experienced such refreshing coolness, and the bright moon in the sky had never been so enchanting. She would no longer be dispossessed and would no longer have to look up to others. Su Li Shi stepped forward and continued her contemplation that in 63 years as a human being, she could finally lift her head and take a deep breath of the cool pungent air. She then spread her arms as it was the first time for her in 36 years, and as another day passed by, Su Li Shi was eating grapes in the yard. Lai Dadu arrived and informed her that he had found some people she had been searching for. Su Li Shi asked him if they were good and proceeded to advise him not to be like last time when he found her some losers who couldn't do anything. Lai Dadu told her that the people he recruited were all tough guys with blood on their hands. However, he asked Su Li Shi as he was wondering if they really wanted to deal with those kinds of people. Su Li Shi responded that they needed to, and if there were some tough people in their house, Cheng Dalei wouldn't be able to come freely. She then ordered him to call his people over. Lai Dadu called the people to come in and introduce them to Su Li Shi as they were all famous personalities, and the ones who were skilled were usually in a bad mood. Su Li Shi told him that only those who were skilled had temperament and were hard to find in the world. She told Lai Dadu to be cautious as she believed that Cheng Dalei's people had sneaked inside the town and that he could command the men that he had gathered. Su Li Shi went on to say that as long as Cheng Dalei was not dead, everything could go wrong. She noticed that there was a child among the men and asked Lai Datu why the child was there. Lai Datu informed her that the child's name was Gong Yongai, and that he had neither father nor mother. He also mentioned that the child was not simple as he had also been sold to a trafficker a few years ago, and that as a result, all traffickers died overnight, and all the traces were also burned afterward. He continued informing Su Li Shi that when they found Gong Yongai, they had to get him out of the pile of corpses as he was still strangling the trafficker's neck with both hands. Su Li Shi leaned closer and held Gong Yongai's chin and told him to look up at her. She also asked how old he was, to which he answered that he was 16. She then told him that he would be with her from that point forward and asked him why he was still wearing old clothes and that they would take him to make two new cloth sets in a few days. Stuttering, Gong Yongai responded that she didn't need to. Su Li Shi laughed and told Gong Yongai that he had been one of them from that moment, and that she had to treat him better. Evening arrived, and the drunk General Kaio strolled down the street when he was complimented by a woman who asked him not to forget them after his promotion, to which he laughed. General Kaio laughed again and walked away, and the two women gossiped, telling each other that General Kaio had hit his stride lately, and that his concubine was pregnant with a child, while the other smiled and repeated what the other woman had said. General Kaio arrived at his home and knocked on the door, asking the people inside to open it. The door opened, and he then called out to his wife, and he noticed that no one was there and wondered where everyone had been and why they hadn't lit up in the middle of the night, while an unknown man stood beside him, staring. 
a hand appeared and covered General Kaio's mouth, and a knife was placed on his neck, which sobered him up. The unknown men ordered him not to move. General Kaio was cornered and was told by one of the men that he had been busy lately, that he had been coming home so late at night. General Kaio responded and asked them not to take the lives of his wife and child and if they wanted silver, they should just ask. The man asked him how much silver he could own in his account as he had some borrowed loans from his love of gambling. Dejected, General Kaio asked the man why he had come to his house when he had been investigating so thoroughly. The man then informed him that they had come to visit him not to ask for money, as they were there to give him some money, and he poured a huge amount of silver. General Kaio stared at the silver and told the man that he would not dare to take the money without having done something for it. The man pointed his knife at him and told him that they had come to make a deal with him, and that if he promised, they would offer a thousand tails of silver, but if he did not, they would exterminate his entire family while the other man held a knife to General Kaio's wife. Enraged, General Kaio asked them if they were from the Toad Village, to which the man answered that he was really smart. General Kaio responded that even with more silver, he could never have released Cheng Dalainot, not because he didn't want to, but because he couldn't. The man squatted and pointed his knife at General Kaio's wife, telling him that Cheng Dale had gotten lost and stuck in the Fallen Leaves City, and that as a soldier, he had to catch a bandit, and that they couldn't blame him. He went on to say that their master's body wasn't made for hard work, so he would ask General Kaio once again to be gentler in prison. General Kaio told the man that Cheng Dale was not in his care, so he couldn't help them even if he had wanted to. The man clapped and assured General Kaio that the 1,000 tails were for him, and another 1,000 tails would also be his. Two boxes of silver tails clattered on the floor beside General Kaio, which made him wonder if the Toad Village was rich. The man stood up and told General Kaio that they would talk on another day as their journey would be long and bid him farewell. And as they were about to leave, General Kaio asked the man if he wasn't afraid that after they left, he would betray them and take the silver without doing anything. The man looked at him and replied that if he took the money and did nothing, they would have to take something away from him the next time they visited and threatened him that it was difficult to protect against bandits in the long run. General Kaio trembled as he wondered what the man would take away, and began mumbling some body parts before concluding that it was the heads of his entire family. The man then told his men that they would get going, as General Kaio was staring at the scattered tails of silver. General Kaio thought that his choice didn't seem to be difficult. The next day, Su Lishi was talking to General Kaio, asking him when he would kill Cheng Dale and eliminate evil for human beings. General Kaio responded and told Su Lishi that the matter was not his responsibility. Su Lishi opened a box and was about to bribe him, however, she was stopped by General Kaio, telling her that he declined as he couldn't accept her money. Su Lishi then wondered what was going on and when General Kaio had become so clean. Meanwhile at the Toad Village camp, Gao Fei Hu informed them that he had looked at the area around the prison. And when Cheng Da Lai was arrested, a lot of troops had been deployed outside the prison. He then told them that it was not realistic for them to storm the prison unless they did it on the way when they took Cheng Da Lai somewhere else. Zhu Shenji questioned Gao Fei Hu if he had taken care of everything in prison. Gao Fei Hu continued to report that the money had been sent to Kai Yi, believing that he would be careful after taking the money, and that Cheng Da Lai could have an easy time inside the prison. Concerned, Zhu Shenji mumbled that given Cheng Dale's behavior, he was worried that they would execute him on the spot, claiming that it couldn't be ruled out. Gao Fei responded that, based on the head of the cell, Cheng Dale was in a separate cell and was not currently sentenced, and that the head had promised to take care of him. Su Ying was depressed, while Zhu Shenji asked Gao Fei Hu how much silver they had left, to which he responded that there was not much left. Gao Fei Hu then told them that when he met with the head of the prison, he had heard a message from him that someone was trying to bribe him. Su Ying stood up and told Zioda to follow her, and as she walked out, Zioda asked Su Ying to wait for her. Concerned, Gao Fei Hu instructed White Wolf to bring two fighters with her and to keep an eye on Su Ying, to which the White Wolf agreed. He also wondered where Su Ying would go. A little while later at the Su family household, Su Li Shi told Su Ying that she had missed her and was about to send someone to look for her, and after that, she invited her to have a mother and daughter conversation with her. She went on and said that although Su Sihai didn't recognize her as his daughter, she had always treated her as her own. Su Li Shi smiled and told Su Ying that she had never come to see her, and as a mother, she could hardly come to her. Su Ying stood straight in front of Su Li Shi and asked her if she thought that it was funny. They then stared intently at each other. Su Lishi closed her eyes as she was about to drink her cup and asked Su Ying the reason for her visit. 
Su Ying straightforwardly told her that she didn't want the Su family property, and what she wanted was a sum of silver. Su Li she asked her what she meant by Su family properties and told her that from what she knew when Su Sehai kicked her out, Su Ying was already not part of the family. Su Ying retorted that she had known for a long time that Su Sehai had given her all the Su family's fortune before he died, and that the reason she had visited her was not to divide the property, but to give it all up to the Su family property, as she only wanted a sum of silver. Su Li Shi then reminded her that her restaurant was also a property of the Su family, to which Su Ying responded that she couldn't give it up. Su Li Shi asked her how much silver she wanted, and when Su Ying told her the number she wanted, Su Li Shi kept declining. Agitated, Su Ying informed her that the fields of the Su family, and the business in the city and on the docks, wondering if it was still not worth 10,000 silver. Su Li Shi raised three fingers and told her that the values of those businesses had nothing to do with it, and the best she could give her was 3,000 silver at most. Su Ying clenched her teeth in anger and agreed. Su Li Shi then told her that her words were not proof, to which Su Ying responded that writing was her proof. She took a brush and suggested to Su Ying that she would have to let her subordinates send it to her, as 3,000 silver was not a small amount and she wouldn't be able to transport it as she passed the contract to Su Ying. After their negotiation, Su Ying walked out. However, she told Su Li Shi that if she didn't send the silver, she had to watch out for God to punish her, as God was watching. Su Li Shi responded and assured her that God had not yet taken her, a wife of a bandit, which proved that God was blind. And as Su Li Shi held their contract paper, she then grinned and ordered her men to leave the wagon. After a while at the city lord's residence, a fat man asked Su Li Shi why she had visited, claiming that she should be at home grieving. Su Li Shi sighed and told the city lord that she wouldn't have come to him if some obstacle hadn't existed. The city lord asked her if something had happened. Su Li Shi informed him that Cheng Dale had done a lot of bad things, and that when he was caught, his people kept blaming her for what happened and kept coming to her house to make trouble. She then stated her reason for coming. She came to ask when he would kill Cheng Dale to destroy the rays of hope left on his men. The city lord grinned and informed her about the situation, telling her that the fact he caught Cheng Dale was a great accomplishment, and that he was more worthy of being alive than dead. He went on and informed her that they had let Cheng Dale alive, in case the mountain bandits of the Toad Village went crazy. He would serve as a hostage. Su Li Shi understood and took a box, telling him that before Su Sehai died, he had promised to give a luminous pearl to the city lord and that that day she had brought it especially for him. The city lord asked her what she meant. She then opened the box, which contained a shiny pearl, to which the city lord was happy and mumbled that Su Sehai was really a great person who remembered the dead even before dying. Su Li Shi changed the subject, which reminded the city lord of their conversation with Cheng Dale and the city lord assured her that he would take care of it while eyeing the shiny pearl. Su Li Shi closed the box, and the city lord asked her if there was something else she wanted him to do. She told him that she just had a few family matters, that Su Ying was a disgrace to the Su family, and after Su Sehai died, there was no one who was able to control her. Earlier that day, she had come to her to exchange her family fortune for 3,000 silver to spend. She went on and said that the Su family fortune should be passed on to her in a few years. However, she believed that with Su Ying's current temperament, she didn't feel comfortable leaving the Su family to her. The city lord couldn't believe that there was such a thing. Su Li Shi grinned and told him that she had also written a receipt for Su Ying, and that she would send someone later to deliver the silver. However, she was afraid that on that day it would be 3,000 tails, and the next time it would be 5,000. She would keep coming back to her, asking for money, and as her mother, she couldn't give her money, and the Su family couldn't afford Su Ying spending so much money. Worried, the city lord suggested that Su Ying should be properly controlled. Su Li Shi then gave him the box and told him that after the death of Su Sehai, she had dared not to educate her. However, as her stepmother, everything she said had no effect. The city lord smiled and assured Su Li Shi that he would do it for her, and that the receipt would stay with him. If Su Ying asked her for money again, she would have to see him. Meanwhile, at the front door of the Su family, Su Ying wondered why the silver Su Li Shi had promised was taking so long. The man closed the door aggressively and told her to ask the city lord for money and to get lost. When she went to the city lord's manor, she was yelled at for having a large family fortune, and he was still not satisfied, asking her what she needed the money for and telling her to get out of his place. The city lord continued to scold her and asked her if her heart was clouded and suggested why she wouldn't go to Cheng Dale and ask for money. Su Ying felt dejected as she listened to every curse word that had been said to her. 
She then walked down the city streets, face down, as two men stalked her. Su Ying's face frowned, however, moments later a hand grabbed her shoulder, and a voice called out to her. She turned around and met White Wolf, who told her that she had been secretly watching her and wanted to stop her when she saw her going to the Su family. But something terrible happened in the end. She went on and said that it didn't matter when someone's time had passed, it could still be settled with the Su family. She held her hands and told her that they were going back as it was not safe where they were. A man held a bloody spear, and a massive pile of bodies lay down the street, while Zhao Zilong stood and stared at them. A voice then yelled that the Su family was full of bullies and ordered some of his men to follow him to destroy the Su family. Liu Bei told Gao Fei Hu to calm down, that no matter how he said it, they were still Su Ying's family. Fuming, Zhu Shenji asked Liu Bei how he could stay calm as they had already used countless amounts of silver and still got no way to save Cheng Dale. He suggested that they should just storm the prison. Munching on his food, Liu Bei then told them that if they wanted to do it, it would be much better to wait and relocate Cheng Dale, as he was more valuable alive than dead. He believed that Cheng Dale would definitely not be executed secretly. Su Ying chimed in that she thought it couldn't be said that there was no way, and that before she went to the city lord's residence, she found a method that they could try. Liu Bei asked what her method was. Su Ying responded that she had heard that Wan Baoshan went fishing at the pier every 20th of the month, and if they kidnapped him, she believed that they could trade him back for Cheng Dale. Liu Bei inquired about the day they were in, to which Guan Yu replied that it was the 19th, and that the 20th would be tomorrow. Lai Dadu had stood on his balcony, looking out at the cloudy sky. One of his attendants informed him that he was afraid it might rain that day and asked if they should still sail. Lai Dadu asked him why they shouldn't sail because it was only his hobby, as if he couldn't enjoy just one hobby. His attendant also informed him that a person from the Su family had visited once again. Lai Dadu turned to face his attendant, asking if she had returned and how much she had disliked the woman. He ordered his attendant to inform the woman that they were going to execute Cheng Dale on that night and also not to bother him any longer. Lai Dadu told his attendant that he needed to hurry up and stop interfering with his enjoyment. Quite a number of spears appeared while the soldier yelled that they were going. Meanwhile, Su Lishi complained that she had been walking around so much every day for the past two days, and she had already gotten blisters on her feet. She asked someone to massage her feet, however, the person was reluctant. Su Lishi asked him if he had disliked her, to which the man answered that he hadn't dared. She sighed and told Gong Yangai that if people like them didn't help each other, there would be no one who would respect them as he held her feet. She went on to say that it was also because they were meant for the same thing, that when she saw her, she felt close to her in her heart, asking him not to take offense as she really saw him as her own brother. As Gong Yangai was massaging Su Lishi's foot, she told him to be gentler as she was hurt. She reminded him to be gentle on a woman's foot and asked him why he was holding her feet so tightly, as if he were a simpleton. Gong Yangai responded that since he was a child, he used to massage his mother's foot, to which Su Lishi asked him if he could also call him his mom. Gong Yangai blushed and didn't speak a word. Su Lishi grinned and wondered if what she was doing was what people with higher power could enjoy, and that once she had been the admired beauty. However, she had become the observer as she moved her hands towards Gong Yangai. As she twirled some of Gong Yangai's hair, she wondered if it was the kind of power some stinking men sought. She moved her hands, pinching his cheeks, with the thought of playing with people as if they were toys, which led her to the conclusion that it was fantastic. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village group, a man reported to Zhu Shenji that they had found out that Fang Boshin had left his residence and was heading to the pier. Zhu Shenji spoke up, telling them that the battle that day would be a sure victory, but it would also be bloody, and that because Cheng Dale had treated them well, they couldn't bear seeing him suffer in prison any longer. He went on to say that after that day, he was afraid that he would not see many of them in the future and if someone was afraid, he would not be for him. He suggested that they drink now, and that when they walked out the door, they would be brothers forever. A man voiced out asking what Zhu Shenji was talking about and that he could just say that they could lay down their lives for Cheng Dale as he also did the same for them. The men agreed. They were told that they were going to drink wine together until it was empty and that they would go together to save Cheng Dale as a firework swooshed into the air and made a huge bang in the sky. Fang Boshin noticed the fireworks and asked one of his subordinates why they were being set off in broad daylight. One of his subordinates asked Fang Boshin if he wanted him to send someone to take a look, to which Fang Boshin responded that there was no need for it, suggesting that they needed to pick up the pace as they would need to be faster. Zhao Zilong stood on top of one of the house roofs, holding a bow, watching them, while Liu Bei and Zhang Fei were hiding in an alley. Watching Fang Boshin's movements, Kin Man and Lin Xiao Yu were doing the same on the other side. 
Anxious, Gao Fei Hu informed Zhu Shenji that they didn't have much time before Fang Bashan arrived at the port, and that their only problem was that the fireworks signal outside the city had yet to appear. He asked Zhu Shenji what they were going to do, informing him that waiting for Fang Bashan to arrive at the docks would be much more difficult than catching him on the roads. Frustrated, Zhu Shenji gritted his teeth and told them that they would wait for another 15 minutes, and if there was still no signal, they would attack. Gao Fei who tightly gripped his sword and said nothing. The cartwheel made a noise, and an arrowhead pointed towards Fang Bashan. Zhao Zilong concentrated, and the sound of a galloping horse was heard. Two men rushed into the city and covered the gate with some sand smoke. One of Zhu Shenji's men informed him that 15 minutes had passed as Gao Fei who readied himself and held his sword. Zhu Shenji commanded them that they were going to do it and attacked. Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei Bao screamed, ordering their men to attack. Sleeping, Fang Bashan's men were ordering their subordinates to stop the wagon, asking the man who had just entered the city who he was. He woke up from the noise of his men ordering the unknown man not to move, which made him wonder. Fang Bashan asked one of his men what was going on and told them they could just pursue his hobby in peace. Tai Dekyang, the man who had entered the city, introduced himself and asked to see Fang Bashan. Huang Sanyuan came running, asking his subordinates to stop. Gao Fei Bao asked Gao Fei Hu what Huang Senyuan was doing and wondered if something had happened at the Toad Village. Huang Senyuan anxiously informed them that Cheng Dale had been saved and that they could all stop now. Zhu Shenji was in disbelief and yelled, wondering if Yang Longting had given Cheng Dale the title. Huang Senyuan told him that Cheng Dale had received a title as one of the two generals of the rangers, rewarded with a hundred tails of silver, armor, a noble horse, and much more. He informed them that they had also received many promotions, like a hundred chief lieutenants. However, Yang Longting had not yet appointed anyone for the position and had left Cheng Dale for the decision. White Wolf asked if they didn't have anything to do after Cheng Dale got the position. Huang Xinyun enthusiastically informed them that Yang Longting would never allow a temporary mistake to ruin a long-term plan, and that Kai Degang had gone to Fang Bashan to save Cheng Dale. Dejected, Zhu Shenji sat in the corner contemplating giving Huang Senyuan the impression that he was disappointed. Zhu Shenji spoke and told them that he could no longer talk about regrets, and that he had just drunk too much wine that went to his head, which made the people around him speechless. Fang Boshan asked Kai Degang if he wanted him to release Cheng Dale. Kai Degang responded that it was Yang Longting who wanted Cheng Dale released because he belonged to him and asked Fang Boshan not to kill him. Fang Boshan was in doubt and told Kai Degang that it had taken him great effort to catch Cheng Dale and if he released him, it wouldn't be easy to catch him next time. Kai Degang informed Fang Bashan that Cheng Dale had sworn allegiance to Yang Longton long ago, and that Yang Longting had cherished him as a talent, and that there was no way he would appoint him a general out of all the rangers. He continued by saying that Cheng Dale was now one of Yang Longting's people, and he asked Fang Bashan if he wanted to arrest some of Yang Longting's people, as well as if he hadn't tortured him in prison. Anxious, Fang Bashan felt nervous and thought that before Su Li Shi came, he had asked the head of the prison to take care of Cheng Dale. He believed that with the head's temperament, Cheng Dale had at least one layer of skin peeled off if he hadn't died. Depressed, with snot coming down Fang Boshan's nose, he couldn't finish informing Kai Degang about Cheng Dale's situation. Kai Degang was sweating heavily and yelled at Fang Boshan to take him to where Cheng Dale was being held right at that moment. After some time, they arrived at some sort of a dungeon where Kai Degang asked Fang Boshan if he was sure that Cheng Dale was still alive. Still anxious, Fang Boshan reassured Kai Degang that he understood the people under him and believed that they had been gentle with Cheng Dale. He hoped Cheng Dale had a strong life force and must have been alive to the point where he could be saved. A man's voice mumbled about how much Du Mao was worth and how he should have been his equal, that the man from the Ring tribe had been strong enough to hold three out of five rounds against him in a horse fight. A couple of men inside the prison with Cheng Dale asked him to tell them more about the method of the five thunderbolts, as they had heard that the gods had taught him in his dream. Cheng Dale smiled and enthusiastically asked them if they could understand if he told them about the gods, while a bald man was all smiles serving him his meal. While Cheng Dale stated that the method of the five thunderbolts had been too powerful for him to use easily because it destroyed too much and proceeded to ask the soldier who had been serving him what they would be eating that day. A few delicacies were served. Disappointed by what had been served, Cheng Dale asked if they could eat something milder, and that speaking of fish, he knew a way to eat fish raw, that if they dipped it in sauces, it would bring a wave of flavor. The men were amazed and told Cheng Dale that he had seen a lot of things, to which he agreed. 
At the same time, Fang Baoshan and Kai Degand arrived at Cheng Dalei's cell and were speechless. Fang Baoshan tapped the prison guard's shoulder and asked him what it was all about, to which the guard turned to look at the man behind him. He responded to Fang Baoshan that he had been the one who ordered him to take care of Cheng Dalei. Fang Baoshan became enraged and told the guard that they had taken his orders literally and taken care of Cheng Dalei far too well. The two of them approached Cheng Dalei's cell, with Fang Baoshan telling Cheng Dalei that if he had been careless, he would have made him suffer. They drew Cheng Dalei's attention, with him noticing Kai Degang first and telling him about how he had suffered over the previous few days. Kai Degang believed that Cheng Dalei hadn't suffered and that he had eaten much better than he had. Cheng Dalei asked who the man with Kai Degang was, and Kai Degang said he had been the local city lord, Fang Baoshan. Fang Baoshan cried and told Cheng Dalei that he had suffered enough. Cheng Dalei's face became serious as he remembered seeing Fang Baoshan's name somewhere, and proceeded to ask him if they had ever met before. Fang Baoshan grinned and told Cheng Dalei that he had admired him for a long time, believing that their meeting was fate before turning to scold the prison guard for remaining standing and ordering him to open the cell door. Cheng Dalei got out and pleaded with Fang Baoshan to let his buddies out too. Fang Baoshan clasped his hand and reassured Cheng Dalei that he would immediately set his buddies free as his friends were also his. He informed Cheng Dalei that Yang Longting had promoted him to one of the two generals of the rangers and that the official uniform and military seal were in the city master's residence, and asked him if he had to go there with him. He went on and told Cheng Dalei that it was now the time for him to wash the unhappiness out of his body as he had come out of such a place. As they came outside the prison, Cheng Dalei stretched his arm in relief and mumbled that he had now tasted freedom. Disappointed, Fang Baoshan spoke to the prison warden and asked him how much silver he had received, as it was hard for him to trick him as he was not foolish. He ordered the prison warden to call all the people who had taken the silver, as they needed to talk, to which the prison warden obeyed. Fang Baoshan was enraged by the idea that he didn't get a single coin. However, his men all ate until their bellies burst, as he was like Kong Fang Shin. After a while at the city lord's residence, Fang Baoshan wondered if it was all of them. He yelled after learning that many people had received silver. Fang Baoshan couldn't believe that from the smallest to the chief cook of the prison, to the military general Kaiohi, and even the advisors at his side, they had taken Toad Village silver. He wondered if it was all about Cheng Dalei's safety or their own lives. Meanwhile, at the city lord's mansion, back house, Cheng Dalei felt satisfied while taking a bath, and after that, he was dressed by the two female attendants. They also combed his hair and tied his shoes. He mumbled, stating his title as General Cheng, and that his outfit fit him perfectly and was made specifically for him. Cheng Dalei told his attendants that he used to buy clothes and the attendant used to tell him he was handsome in his clothes and that they suited him. A man arrived behind Cheng Dalei and called him. Cheng Dalei turned and told Kai Degang that they would be colleagues from that moment. Kai Degang was with some company, passed Cheng Dalei the enrollment papers, a hundred tales of silver, and the official seal, along with the other rewards that Yang Longting wanted him to have. He went on to say that the official seal was specially made for him by Yang Longting and asked him if he liked it. Dejected, Cheng Dalei couldn't speak a word as he saw a huge golden toad and wondered why there was a toad sitting on the official seal. Kai Degang asked Cheng Dalei if he liked what Yang Longting had specially made for him, while Cheng Dalei looked depressed. Cheng Dalei took a deep breath and responded that he would ride into battle for Yang Longting even if he died. Fang Baoshan wondered if Cheng Dalei had such deep feelings for Yang Longting. He grinned and told Cheng Dalei that in the last few days he had suffered enough, as it was like the flood had dashed against the Temple of the Dragon King. He clapped his hands, ordering his men to come, and a few people appeared, bringing with them boxes. They lined up the boxes which contained a huge amount of silver, and Fang Baoshan informed Cheng Dalei that the silver had yet to be returned to him and his subordinates had eyes but failed to see. Cheng Dalei responded by telling them that the silver was his gift to his friends because they had all been working hard lately and he wanted them to divide it among themselves. Fang Baoshan's men thanked Cheng Dalei for his gratitude. Kai Degang was watching what was happening and wondered what Cheng Dalei was greedy for, as he had never seen a mountain bandit who was not greedy for money. He reasoned that once everything was settled, they needed to get rid of Cheng Dalei because such a person should never have been alive. Kai Degang was confused after he saw Cheng Dalei and Fang Baoshan whispering, to which Cheng Dalei told Fang Baoshan that he still had some personal matters he would like to talk to him about. They proceeded to whisper as Kai Degang watched them from behind. Cheng Dalei walked and waved his hand behind as Fang Baoshan told him that he had a good point, which left Kai Degang wondering. 
Tai De Gang approached Fang Boshan and asked him what they had discussed, as Cheng Dalei seemed happy. Fang Boshan responded that they had discussed nothing, as Cheng Dalei had just asked him if he had access to female slaves that he could buy. He told Kai De Gang happily that Cheng Dalei was an interpersonal man and it was said that he had been put in prison because of a woman. Kai De Gang was disappointed and thought that Cheng Dalei was just a pervert, believing that he was not greedy for money but greedy for sex. A moment later, Fang Boshan and Kai De Gang were seeing off Cheng Dalei in front of the gate. Fang Boshan asked him if he should send some people to take him back to the mountain, as he believed that it was a long way back, while Cheng Dalei was petting his horse ride. Cheng Dalei had told them that he didn't want to go back to the Toad Village just yet, as it was about time for his men to arrive. A group of people was seen walking towards them, stopped in front of the city lord's mansion gate. Cheng Dalei's men had clasped both of their hands simultaneously and greeted him. Kai De Gang and Fang Boshan, who were watching, wondered when so many people had sneaked into the Fallen Leaf City. Cheng Dalei smiled and told his men that they should call him by his title, General Cheng, at that moment and ordered that they were going to get going. While trudging away, Cheng Dalei sang a song in which he stated that he had also attended the Qianling Banquet, ridden through the street in front of the palace gate, and that everyone had praised his beauty. Moments later, snow was seen falling, which meant the start of winter. Su Ying and Sai Oda were standing by the side of the road, and Sai Oda reassured her that she didn't need to worry because she had heard that they had released Cheng Dalei believing that he would return later. Su Ying's face was still gloomy, a second passed by and a galloping horse arrived. Cheng Dalei stepped down from his horse and greeted Su Ying. Su Ying's eyes were wide open, and the umbrella that she was holding left her hands as she ran towards Cheng Dalei. She hugged Cheng Dalei, which he also did the same and cried on his shoulders. Cheng Dalei comforted her, assuring her that everything was fine, as they could go and do business now. Puzzled, Su Ying asked him what he meant, to which Cheng Dalei responded that they were going to take back what belonged to her. Meanwhile, Su Lishi was taking off the clothes of Gong Yangai, asking him if the new clothes would fit him. Gong Yangai called Su Lishi Madam, but was interrupted by her, telling him not to call her Madam as she was only a few years older than him and if he didn't mind, he could call her sister. Uncomfortable, Gong Yangai called Su Lishi Ru sister. However, Su Lishi leaned close to him, noticing his scars and mumbling that he might have suffered a lot. She asked him if he could tell her the story of the scars. Gong Yangai recalled his time as a slave, which made his eyes bulge, and he could only remember blood. He told Su Lishi that they were just some ugly scars. Su Lishi chuckled and told Gong Yangai that she used to be just like him before, but they hadn't dared hurt her tender flesh. She was relieved that he was pure even if he was wounded and asked him if he wouldn't look down on her for what she had said, to which Gong Yangai responded that he wouldn't dare to. Su Lishi leaned closer, making Gong Yangai blush as she asked him if he had ever touched a woman, to which he replied that he hadn't. She whispered in his ear and told him that she would help him find one, and that his body would be loved by women. Lai Dadu arrived anxiously and reported to Su Lishi that something big had happened. Su Lishi turned to him annoyed and asked him why he was yelling. Lai Dadu's face blackened as he informed Su Lishi that Cheng Dalei had come to settle scores with them. Su Lishi inquired about the whereabouts of the guard and people, having been informed by Lai Dadu that everyone had fled due to Cheng Dalei's beating. She was told to proceed to the main hall, where they had all gathered and were waiting for her. She cursed at them, stating that they were a bunch of scum. Upon arriving at the main hall, she was met by a group of men lined up on her left and right, with Cheng Dalei sitting in front of her, and Su Ying beside him. Cheng Dalei's men gazed at Su Lishi. Su Lishi spoke, asking Cheng Dalei what he had been doing in her mansion again. Cheng Dalei responded that he had come for the purpose of dividing the family property. He claimed that it was normal for him, as the Su family's son-in-law, to share the family fortune. Su Lishi gritted her teeth, wondering how a mountain bandit could talk about dividing the family fortune. Cheng Dalei coughed, and Zhu Shenji, who was also sitting beside him with the official seal, told her to watch her language. He informed her that Cheng Dalei was one of the two generals of rangers and asked her what she meant by calling him a mountain bandit. He told her to open her eyes and see the official seal, the title that had been bestowed upon Cheng Dalei by Yang Longting. Cheng Dalei was one of the two generals of rangers who led the battalion of King Niu Mountain. Su Lishi was sweating, wondering how Cheng Dalei, who was hated by everyone, had become a general. She told them that discussing the division of the family property was not impossible. However, she insisted that they must invite all the elders of the Su family to be present as witnesses. Cheng Dalei smiled and assured Su Lishi not to worry. 
he claimed to have considered the matter and clapped his hands, ordering his men to bring in the elders. A group of dejected-looking men arrived as Cheng Dale announced that he had invited all the relatives to discuss the division of the family property. Su Li she held the contract she had made with Su Ying and told them that she had been excluded from the Su family. Therefore, she had no right to demand a single penny from the family. However, as her mother, she couldn't bear to see her daughter suffer. She also informed them that two days ago, she had received a note indicating that Su Ying had taken 3,000 tails of silver from her and was prepared to relinquish all claims to the family property. She believed that they would understand this at a glance. Su Ying became agitated and yelled that Su Li Shi was talking nonsense, as she hadn't received any silver from her at all. Su Li Shi scoffed and asked Su Ying if she thought everyone present was as stupid as those who still had the receipt. One of the elders took the note and informed the crowd that the date and fingerprint could be confirmed, as he realized that the handwriting was indeed from Su Ying. Su Ying was being consumed by agitation while listening to the elders. They mentioned that the note also had the name of the city lord Fang Bashan as a witness on it. She wondered if Fang Bashan was truly a witness, as the elder assured them that the reference was true and not fake. Su Li Shi smiled, thinking that Su Ying was still too young, and wondered if she had come that day to discuss the family fortune. Cheng Dale grabbed Su Ying's wrist, causing her to look at him and notice the smile he held on his face. Su Li Shi passed the note to Cheng Dale, telling him to take a look. Cheng Dale told her to address him as General Cheng. He warned that if she treated him like a mountain bandit again, he might consider it an insult to the empire. He slammed the note, creating a loud bang sound. Su Li Shi's eyes narrowed as she asked Cheng Dale if he didn't want to read the note. Cheng Dale responded that he didn't need to read the note, as for him, it didn't matter. Anxious, Su Li Shi asked him why it didn't matter, to which Cheng Dale told her in an aggressive tone that if he said it didn't matter, then it didn't, and there was no reason why. Su Li Shi's face darkened as she told Cheng Dale that she feared Fang Bashan wouldn't agree. She ordered Lai Dadu to bring Fang Bashan as a witness, to which Lai Dadu quickly obeyed. Cheng Dale took a sip from his cup and advised Su Li Shi not to bother, stating that even if she invited Fang Bashan, he would not come. Lai Dadu quickly ran and passed through the Su residence gate. After some time, he came back, catching his breath and sweating. Su Li Shi asked him what was going on and where Fang Bashan was. Lai Dadu was catching his breath and sweating as he informed Su Li Shi that he didn't even see Fang Bashan's face. He just sent him a message. And the message's content was that there was no reason why Su Ying should not inherit the family property when her father died, which caused Su Li Shi's eyes to widen. Again, Su Li Shi's face darkened, and she thought that everything was gone in the end. She believed that it was such a moronic reason that there was no reasoning without power. She clenched her fist and thought that it had turned out that in the world there was only one truth that was unchangeable, and whoever had more power was also right. Su Li Shi asked Cheng Dale if she could talk to him alone, to which Cheng Dale responded, why couldn't they talk at the same place? Su Li Shi told him that there were some things she would like to share with him in private, which made Cheng Dale think, and later on, he agreed. They arrived in an empty room as Cheng Dale asked her what she wanted to say. Su Li Shi bowed and knelt, telling Cheng Dale that at the moment she had felt like a little bird in his hand, that he could easily take her life by crushing her or let her lie by giving her some rice to eat. She looked at Cheng Dale as she begged him to spare a few grains of rice and her life, as what she had been only looking for was just stability, and in the future, she would not regret anything even if she had to be a slave. Zioda and Su Ying spent time on a balcony, as Zioda told Su Ying that because Cheng Dale had been a mountain bandit, they had been exposed to people's disputes in the past. She believed that after that day, no one in the family would dare to gossip about Su Ying, because Cheng Dale had become a general. Xiao enthusiastically said that there was nothing more glorious than having a general as a husband, and that by marrying the general who led the army, the Su family was said to have risen high. Meanwhile, in the room where Cheng Dale and Su Li Shi were having their talk, Su Li Shi glanced at Cheng Dale and told him that she had done everything she could, but in the end, she had come up empty-handed. She begged him to show a little mercy and give her family a way to live. Cheng Dale's face darkened as he blushed, stuttered, and asked her if she could stand up and talk. Su Li Shi stood up and leaned closer to the flustered Cheng Dale, telling him that if he wanted her to do something, they could do it right there. She flirtatiously put her hand on her chest, informing Cheng Dale that she was meant to serve people and was very good at it. Su Ying, who was sitting on the edge of the railing, stared at the sky while Xiaoda ate beside her. She thought that Cheng Dale and Su Li Shi's talk was taking so long and wondered what they had been talking about. Flustered, Cheng Dale couldn't muster a word as Su Li Shi's aggression towards him made him feel uncomfortable. 
she asked him what he wanted her to do. Cheng Dale ordered her not to get so close. Su Li Shi still continued her flirtatious approach and told Cheng Dale that she still had great confidence in her body. She asked him if he wanted to try. Cheng Dale gulped as he became sweatier. Su Li Shi smiled and thought that Cheng Dale was just a mountain bandit after all. Cheng Dale's eyes darkened as he told Su Li Shi to keep her distance because she was stepping on his robe which was the official uniform for the general and hadn't been washed yet. Su Lishi's face contorted as she couldn't believe what Cheng Dale had said. She wondered if he was a blockhead or if she had just overestimated her charm. Cheng Dale's face darkened and he told Su Lishi that stepping on his official robe was like stepping on the official's authority. He also wondered where his cup of tea was as he had been there for so long, and he mocked the Su family for having no rules. A man jumped from the ceiling of the room, it was Gong Yangai, who was a sword coming behind Cheng Dale, who had told him to die. Su Lishi's eyes went wide as she was surprised and wondered when Gong Yangai had hidden himself in the room. Cheng Dale quickly unsheathed his sword and parried Gong Yangai's sword. His face contorted as he thought that Gong Yangai's sword was fierce and wondered when the Su family had such a person. The system popped up Gong Yangai's information. He had been a silent and excellent executioner at just age 16 which made Cheng Dale amazed at his many attributes. Cheng Dale readied his feet and kicked Gong Yong in the face. Gong Yong I flew and flopped, however, he stood up as soon as he fell and ran towards Cheng Dale. Like a fierce beast, Cheng Dale anticipated his attack. He swung his sword, but Gong Yong I was able to duck in time and growled at Cheng Dale seconds after. Gong Yong I tackled Cheng Dale, who was made unable to move and wondered how. He ran and rammed Cheng Dale through the wall, causing a huge banging sound. As he crushed Cheng Dale against the wall, his eyes began to glow red. He pounced on top of him and began his assault on Cheng Dale, who crossed his arms to block Gong Yangai's attack. However, Cheng Dale's head drew some blood, as did his mouth, as he was choked by Gong Yangai, causing him to make a rough noise. Cheng Dale struggled as his face darkened from Gong Yangai choking him, and his sword fell to the ground. Cheng Dale elbowed him in the face, and on defense, Gong Yangai pushed his face. Gong Yangai bit Cheng Dale's arms as he held tight on him, which made Cheng Dale's eyes widen in disdain. Struggling to talk, Cheng Dale palmed Gong Yangai's face, telling him that he was a brat. As he was pushing Gong Yangai's head, he bit him hard, and his clothes were ripped off, including his skin. Cheng Dale cursed at him while still being choked, and he held Gong Yangai's head, asking him if he was a dog. His eyes glowed red as he was about to headbutt him, which made a huge bang. Gong Yangai stepped back, unable to balance himself. Cheng Dale kneeled down as he was coughing, and some blood rushed from his bitten arms. He picked up his sword, stood up, and glanced at each other. Cheng Dale told Gong Yangai that he couldn't kill him, as his men would be arriving soon. He smiled and asked Gong Yangai to follow him so they could drink and eat meat together. Gong Yangai cursed at him, telling Cheng Dale that he had usurped the Su family's property and had forced Su Li Shi to commit to him. He claimed that Cheng Dale was wearing a fake tiger skin and doing things that had forced him to do bad things at the time. A moment later, Cheng Dale's men arrived at the scene with concern and informed him that they had come. One of them asked Cheng Dale who Gong Yongai had been, as his martial arts had been impressive at such a young age. Zhang Fei asked Cheng Dale to step back, as he would handle Gong Yongai on his own. Gong Yongai screamed at them, telling them to step forward as he would kill them all. A hand reached behind him, Su Li Shi's hand wrapped around him, hugging Gong Yongi in concern. Gong Yongai assured Su Li Shi not to be afraid, as he would clear a path for the both of them. Su Li Shi closed her eyes, and a single tear was seen in her eye telling him that he didn't have to and that she wanted him to run away. Su Li Shi interrupted Gong Yangai's thoughts on him running alone by telling him to run because she couldn't. She went on and told him that the matter had originally been her fault and he had had nothing to do with it, so he could just be free to run away. And as for her, she belonged to the Su family, assuring him that she wouldn't die. Su Li Shi yelled at him to go, to which Gong Yangai obeyed, charging in through one of the windows, while the mouth of the man in front of him was wide open. He leaped on the man, and the man stumbled as Gong Yangai landed on his chest, while the other man asked who he was. One of them yelled to stop Gong Yangai, as the others wondered who had come out of the window, and while some were amazed by Gong Yangai's speed, looking through one of the windows Gong Yangai had jumped from, Su Li Shi thought of Gong Yangai as silly, crying. She hoped for him not to get caught, as for her she was just a bird in a cage, and as for Gong Yangai, he was the eagle in the sky, while looking at the horizon where Gong Yangai was running. Dao Fei who asked Cheng Dale if he wanted him to take some of the men to catch Gong Yangai. 
Cheng Dalei's hands raised, expressing his need to stop, and responded that he claimed that Gong Yongai would rather die than be captured by them, and if they were to try, he believed a few of their men would die in the process. Su Lishi kneeled, staring at the ground, while a voice asked Cheng Dalei what they would do with her. Su Lishi was in disdain and said that it was her responsibility, as she couldn't educate Gong Yongai, who was a servant of the Su family and intentionally hurt someone. Cheng Dalei responded that it was now Su Ying's business on how to deal with her, as it was now the Su family's concern and he was not interested in it. And as Gong Yongai, Cheng Dalei pitied him as he saw real talent in him. With a serious look on her face, Su Lishi didn't respond back. After a while, a voice announced that Su Lishi had usurped the first daughter's finances and allowed an evil slave to harm people, so she was expelled from the Su family and would have nothing to do with the Su family's future. While Su Ying stood up in front of her relatives, they went on and announced that those who conspired with Su Lishi and plotted against Su Ying would be expelled from the Su family. Also, the first bloodline would pass the second bloodline, and the property of the children of the second bloodline would revert to the family. The Su family closed their eyes as they listened that the Su family property, such as the fields outside the city, the urban cottage industry, and the cargo ships at the docks, was inherited by the first daughter of the Su family. Su Ying's face was bright as she informed them that the matter had been settled, and in the future, she hoped that they would work together to increase the prosperity of the Su family. As she stepped outside the Su family's gate, a hand holding a bag and a man said that even though the fortune was returned to the Su family, Su Lishi certainly had some private savings and secrets. Another man chimed in that he believed her money was enough to open a small inn outside. Cheng Dalei and Zhu Shenji watched Su Lishi leave. Zhu Shenji warned Cheng Dalei that if the grass had only been cut, he had to be aware of having a snake in his lap and proceeded to ask him if he was too merciful to deal with her. Cheng Dalei retorted that a homeless woman who was Su Lishi was more than a mouse rather than a snake, and that the sword in his hand was to lead heroes from all over the world, and that the Su family affairs were nothing compared to that. Zhu Shenji brushed his beard with his hand and asked Cheng Dalei if he was plotting against Su Lishi. Cheng Dalei smiled and told Zhu Shenji that a rabbit does not foul its own hole because he was uninterested in them, but he was interested in Gong Yangai because he was a rare talent. This prompted Zhu Shenji to question him. Zhu Shenji looked at Cheng Dalei and asked him if he wanted to invite Gong Yangai to the village, as he remembered him saying that the boy didn't like to be bothered. Cheng Dalei, remembering his fight against Gong Yangai, told Zhu Shenji that that was why he wanted him in and that Su Lishi was the key. He ordered Zhu Shenji to put people around her to watch her. He mumbled, believing that it wouldn't be long before Gong Yangai showed up at her place again, and when that opportunity arrived, Cheng Dalei would grab it. The system appeared, informing Cheng Dalei that he had completed his task of helping her fight for the family fortune, and was given a bonus draw time of one, asking if he wanted to draw now. Looking at the system, Cheng Dalei grinned and asked the system if she was done evolving, as he hadn't seen her in a long time. The system didn't answer, which made Cheng Dalei question and call her name. Cheng Dalei took the opportunity and chuckled as he grabbed the system's cheeks and stretched them. The system punched Cheng Dalei in the face, which made Cheng Dalei fly a distance between them. Cheng Dalei fell to the ground, still affected by the impact of the punch and with a red dent on his face. The lottery machine appeared, telling Cheng Dalei that he had a lot of nerve. Even though the system's body was developing, she was still a self-regulating body that he shouldn't just touch. It advised him that after the hit he should wake up and start sobering up. Anxious, Cheng Dalei asked the lottery machine if he was now in charge of the lottery. The lottery machine told Cheng Dalei that he was correct, that he was to fill in for the system at work and that the raffle was a la carte reward. It informed Cheng Dalei that he could choose the type of raffle and the raffle type. It added that Cheng Dalei could choose weapons, secret books, items, characters, mounts, and so on, as they would come out in excellent grade or higher. Cheng Dalei told it to quickly get him the secret book. The lottery machine enthusiastically obeyed, and a huge amount of gotcha balls appeared. A green ball appeared and informed Cheng Dalei that he had acquired the Astral Axe technique and that its level was top. Cheng Dalei's eyes shined, and he thought that he could now finally get the full power out of the ghost-faced axe. Suddenly, another ball dashed and hit the axe technique, which made both Cheng Dalei and the lottery machine's mouths wide open in confusion. The lottery machine mumbled that the ball was a sword technique. A notification popped up, informing Cheng Dalei that he acquired the sword technique off a quick sword and that the first style was straightforward, ultimate power, and crippling. 
Cheng Dale rode on a horse and waved his goodbye to Su Ying and Sayoda. Kai De Gang approached him, asking if he was about to leave. Cheng Dale responded that he was, and although he didn't want to go, he had many things to do in the Toad Village. He asked Kai De Gang if he wanted to stay in his village for a few days so that they could talk more through the nights. Kai De Gang clasped both of his hands in respect and told Cheng Dale that he was also busy with some official business, so he wouldn't be able to bother him. He informed him that, however, some people did want to go to the Toad Village. He went on to say that the ones who wanted to visit were talented people sent by Yang Longting to help. Cheng Dale's face became serious as he believed that it was some form of surveillance. He asked Kai De Gang how many would come. Kai De Gang answered by guessing that there were three or four who would visit. Cheng Dale sighed and told Kai De Gang that he must have been disappointed by him. Kai De Gang held an awkward smile and responded that it was more on Yang Longting's orders and he couldn't help it. Cheng Dale raised his hand and began his speech, stating why they didn't send some more over because what he lacked the most was talented people. Kai De Gang cringed, wondering if Cheng Dale couldn't really understand the real meaning. Later on, the huge wall of the Fallen Leaf City was in the distance. Gao Fei who called Cheng Dale a general and told him that they were strong now. He could now also be promoted to Centurion when they got back. Cheng Dale responded and told him to call him village master in front of their own people, not a general. He went on to say that people should be aware not to become too ambitious just because they had been given something great. For example, he couldn't do whatever he wanted just because he was wearing the general's armor. Gao Fei who asked about what Cheng Dale's promotion meant. Cheng Dale responded that Yang Longting did not let him die in the Fallen Leaf City because he wanted him to die in the great battle against Black Rock City, and that no one would feed cheese to a mouse unless the cheese was attached to a mousetrap. He went on to say that now he had eaten the cheese, the mousetrap would snap shut and the mouse and cat game with Yang Longting was the next big thing. A few days later, they were on the mountain path of King Niu Mountain. A carriage was seen passing, and the inside of it spoke that several of them were going to King Niu Mountain, not only to find out if they were serious about accepting recruitment but also to examine the Toad Village's finances and internal relationships. One of the men inside the carriage said that the Toad Village had annexed 50 other villages, and he didn't believe that they were closely related. While the man on his right responded that he understood the mission, he was worried that the wild mountain bandits were said to eat human flesh. Pei Zizhai, the man with a man bun hair, told them that only a man with great courage could accomplish their mission, and he advised the others that they were intellectuals so they couldn't get tough with the mountain bandits. However, they had to use their brains instead. The fat man mumbled that to investigate, inquire, and differentiate they wouldn't get tough with them, so they had to use their brains. While the man on the raid chimed in that they must crush the toad village with their minds alone and show them the power of intelligence, they told Pei Zizhai that they understood it, to which Pei Zizhai praised them. Later on, they arrived at the front gate of the toad village and introduced themselves as Yang Longting's men whom he had ordered to come and asked them to open the gate quickly. Pei Zizhai sweated and told his companions that they had to be careful when the gate opened and dozens of swordsmen and axe fighters rushed out. They had to immediately run away, to which the others nodded. Suddenly the gate opened, and out of their expectation, the toad village villagers threw flower petals at them, welcoming Yang Longting's men. Zhu Shenji, who led the villagers, welcomed them as they prepared a flag for them. Pei Zizhai and the others' faces turned blue as they didn't expect such a warm welcome. Zhu Shenji and the others grinned, and he told Pei Zizhai that they looked forward to them like winter looks forward to spring light, and that they had long awaited the arrival in their village. The man beside Zhu Shenji flattered Pei Zizhai. Pei Zizhai asked Zhu Shenji who he was. Zhu Shenji held his hand and introduced himself. He was in disbelief as he thought that the Toad Village's attitude was good and that their task didn't seem to be difficult. He claimed that he could even make some profit aside. Pei Zizhai responded that he had come to follow Yang Longting's order and check the Toad Village's situation. He asked them to take the lead, and they answered that they would treat him to food as they believed that he had a long journey. The food served emitted a strong smell. Pei Zizhai and the others' faces darkened as they wondered if the food served was the food they were going to eat. Zhu Shenji chuckled and told them that they were blessed as they normally couldn't eat such things but now had the opportunity today since they had some guests. The man beside Pei Zizhai was depressed and told Pei Zizhai that beautiful women were present and sang for them while they drank and enjoyed the dance. Pei Zizhai responded that when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Trembling, he held his chopstick and was about to get some food, but he stopped. Zhu Shenji's hands collided as he told the depressed Pei Zizhai that he didn't have to be in a hurry as they hadn't prayed yet. 
Pei Zizhai asked Zhu Shenji what he meant. Zhu Shenji began to pray and thanked Yang Longting for the food he had given and whose light illuminated the world, which made Pei Zizhai and his men wonder what Zhu Shenji was doing. Zhu Shenji chuckled and enthusiastically told them that they must pray every day before meals. As Cheng Dalei worships Yang Longting so much that he hangs a portrait of him in his bedroom and bows three times in the morning and three times in the evening. He asked if Pei Zizhai didn't pray before meals, and he responded that they didn't have such a rule at their place. After barely swallowing, Zhu Shenji stood up and told them that they had new people in their family on that day. He asked the villagers to applaud and asked their new brothers to recount the glorious past of Yang Longting. Pei Zizhai asked him if it was really necessary. Zhu Shenji yelled, asking him if he did not respect Yang Longting and if he did not worship him from the bottom of his heart, and not regard him as the light of his heart. He spread his arms towards the villagers and told them that Pei Zizhai seemed embarrassed. He asked them which one of them would stand in for him. A man stood up and happily told them that he would start. He sang a song praising Yang Longting for his achievements. Another villager beside him sighed as he wanted to sing the same thing. Another man wrote a poem for Yang Longting. Zhu Shenji smiled and asked for the next person to perform, and beside him, Pei Zizhai felt dejected by that time. The villagers each presented their praises to Yang Longting while the others cheered for him. Zhu Shenji grinned and told Pei Zizhai that he would be next, which made Pei Zizhai question him. Zhu Shenji told them that they started at 5,000 words, which made Pei Zizhai and his men's jaws widen. Meanwhile, in the valley of the New Toad Village, Liu Bei and Cheng Dalei stood above a peak, staring at the horizon. Liu Bei asked him if he had really decided to use the method against the people sent from Yuzhou. Cheng Dalei responded that he had no other method, as it was not time to fight with Yang Longting. Liu Bei retorted that he didn't think they could hide the New Toad Village from Yang Longting. Cheng Dalei told him that hiding it for a day was better than not hiding it at all, and that eventually the truth would come out but that they were not as strong as Yang Longting at the moment. The villagers at the New Toad Village kept working on the structures as they brought logs from each corner of the village. The system was sleeping as its system evolution was still in progress. Pei Zizhai clasped his hand and asked Zhu Shenji if he could meet Cheng Dalei as he had been idle with them for a long time. Zhu Shenji responded and told him that they could talk with Cheng Dalei another time as he had diarrhea. He suggested that they should talk about the deeds of Yang Longting instead. He asked Pei Zizhai which battle Yang Longting won a great victory against the rings, to which Pei Zizhai replied that it was the battle in Nage Valley. Another question was asked by Zhu Shenji, asking Pei Zizhai how many enemies were killed in the battle, and he answered that there were a thousand who were killed. Zhu Shenji asked another question about the names of those who were killed. Pei Zizhai closed his eyes from the absurd questions. Night came, and the huge campfire was lit. The villagers still praised Yang Longting. Pei Zizhai and his men were in the corner, and he told them that they had been there for a morning run, a prayer before meals, and a discussion before bed about how great Yang Longting was. The man beside Pei Zizhai felt more dejected as he responded that what they ate at the village tasted like animal food. He had seen some meat and wine the other day and had been informed that it was an offering to the king of Yuzhou. He went on and said that the key was that they also ate it with them and that he didn't know how to survive anymore. Zhu Shenji appeared and asked them if they could tell him the top 10 classic quotes of Yang Longting, which shocked Pei Zizhai and his companion. Pei Zizhai gathered his men and murmured that the Toad Village was a bunch of crazies, while the man in the center told them that they were completely unable to find the entry point. The last man told the other two that if they continued, he would go crazy. Zhu Shenji asked them where they were going. Pei Zizhai responded that they were just going for a little pee, which made Zhu Shenji ask if the three of them would pee, believing that they had a good relationship, and they just laughed. After a little while, at the gate of the Toad Village, one of the villagers happily told Zhu Shenji that Pei Zizhai's party was gone, to which Zhu Shenji asked if he was sure. Zhu Shenji raised his arm in happiness and told the men to get the meat and wine from the kitchen as they hadn't eaten meat for days, which made his men happy. One day and one night later at Yuzhu City Military Division, a man yelled, informing the military strategist that someone had come back. Lai Shanyan wondered if Pei Zizhai had witnessed an important piece of information. Pei Zizhai and his men looked out of life in them, which made Lai Shanyan ask what was wrong with him and if he had managed to lose weight. They knelt and bowed in front of Lai Shanyan. Lai Shanyan asked them if the Toad Village had locked them up and beaten them up. Pei Zizhai and the man beside him cried as several days of sad and happy experiences came together and informed Lai Shanyan that the Toad Village hadn't treated them right. Agitated, Lai Shanyan closed his eyes, poked his nose bridge, and mumbled that the Toad Village was shameless, that no matter what Cheng Dalei was up to, they should test him so they would know. 
He pointed at them and informed Pei Zizhai's party that the boss bear of Fuhu Mountain wanted to rebel against Yang Longting, as they also needed to beat the dog before the lion and stain Yuzhu Greenwood with blood. He ordered Pei Zizhai that he should go to the Toad Village one more time to deliver his letter and have them send 1,000 people to fight on Fuhu Mountain. Pei Zizhai begged Lai Shanyan to spare him, and he asked if he was trying to take his life by going back to the Toad Village. Lai Shanyan was confused. Meanwhile, a hand handed a piece of an envelope to Cheng Dale and informed him that it came from Yuzhu. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale what the content of the letter was. Cheng Dale responded that Yuzhu had asked them to raise 1,000 soldiers to help them fight against Fuhu Mountain. Zhu Shenji leaned closer and advised Cheng Dale that they couldn't send soldiers to Yang Longting as he obviously wanted to be on their tail. Cheng Dale looked serious and responded that if you eat a jujube from someone else, you have to give them back a jujube tree as it was the rule in business and that now Yuzhu was waiting for them to give a reply. He burned the letter on the candle's flame and asked Liu Jihan to get him a pen and some paper for him to write. Cheng Dale had told Liu Jihan what to write on the paper. Warning came, and Zhu Shenji thanked a soldier for his hard work. He had asked the soldier if he wanted to stay one night in their village because it was already late, and he would have to take a long way back. He assured him that he would be well treated, which made the soldier shudder. The soldier rode his horse quickly and then turned around and left. Zhu Shenji's eyes sunk as the soldier ran so fast. Meanwhile, at the venerable military strategist, Lai Shanyan wondered if the letter was really the handwriting of a mountain bandit, as he was amazed by how elegant it was. The content of Cheng Dale's letter, as Lai Shanyan was reading it, was just complimenting Lai Shanyan, which made Lai Shanyan cringe. Lai Shanyan continued to read the letter and he thought that even though Cheng Dale spoke disgustingly, he seemed to understand the situation. As Lai Shanyan was reading, Cheng Dale stated in his letter that there were over 5,000 people in the village, but they were old, weak women and children in need of rations. He thought that what Cheng Dale said was true, as the village was short on food and wanting some rations for the winter was normal. While Lai Shanyan had a cup of his tea, he noticed that there was another letter in the envelope stating that Cheng Dale wanted to borrow some supplies from Yang Longting. Lai Shanyan blurted out the water in his mouth as he saw the outrageous supplies Cheng Dale needed. He gritted his teeth as he believed that Cheng Dale should just starve and wondered if he was going to attack Yuzhu City for asking for so many supplies. Lai Shanyan closed his eyes and thought that he had to report to Yang Longting. After a while, Yang Longting's eyes darkened after reading what was in Cheng Dale's letter. He asked Lai Shanyan, who was in front of him, if Cheng Dale was losing his mind. Lai Shanyan responded that he wasn't sure what Cheng Dale was thinking, so he decided to share it with Yang Longting so he could make a decision. Yang Longting mumbled that Cheng Dale not wanting to send troops was reasonable, however, he didn't know what his actual position was. He added and told Lai Shanyan that the warehouse had a few hundred pairs of military boots to send to Cheng Dale, and that if they could kill the boss bear, the rest of the supplies would be sent. Lai Shanyan was against the idea and asked if they would really give Cheng Dale supplies. Yang Longting held the letter and told Lai Shanyan that they would send him his request just to see if he would send troops, as he was not yet rich enough to feed them with his own money. He stood up and inquired from Lai Shanyan about the situation at the Fuhu Mountain. Lai Shanyan informed him that Liu Tai had already gone there, and with him were a thousand soldiers and horses, along with the Green Forest Bandits, totaling two thousand people. He believed that in the next two days they would have news. Yang Longting asked Lai Shanyan to keep an eye on Liu Tai, as the topography of the Fuhu Mountains was complex. It was a largely mountainous area that was not easy for cavalry to attack. Lai Shanyan obeyed, and on that day, Liu Tai led 2,000 soldiers and sent troops to Mount Fuhu. And as a result, Luo Tai failed miserably. Fuhu Mountain's advantage of location drew the enemy deep into the mountain and separated the soldiers and horses. They were crushed one by one, killing hundreds of people and scattering 2,000 soldiers and horses in all directions. Only a thousand people survived the flight back to Yuzhu City. Boss Bear had been a powerful and influential man for many years, so he was not reckless. A man was in disbelief that the king of Yuzhu had given them 500 pairs of military boots. Another man chuckled as now everyone could do their job with 500 boots. While some others said that for them, they were not just military boots but the reputation of the Yang Longting, which they believed they had stepped on. Huang Senyuan informed Cheng Dale about the news brought by the people of Yuzhu. The Luo Tai attack on Fuhu Mountain had almost been beaten to death by Boss Bear, and Yang Longting was enraged, so he demoted Luo Tai directly from general to a horseman who transported grain. Cheng Dale responded with a scoff, telling Huang Senyuan that Luo Tai had used people carelessly, and Yang Longting had been very tolerant of him. 
Now, Liu Tai had just been demoted. Huang Senyuan closed his eyes and informed Cheng Dalie that after Liu Tai's defeat, Yang Longting had personally commanded the army and assembled another thousand soldiers and horses. And just the other day, he had sent troops to Fuhu Mountain. However, Boss Bear was not to be trifled with, and a long-drawn battle was to be expected. Cheng Dale grinned as he had an idea to use Yang Longting to take a few more things from him, as he believed that the Toad Village didn't deserve less. He ordered Liu Jihan to get him a pen and ink. Cheng Dale took the brush and wrote a letter for Yang Longting. Concerned, Liu Jihan asked him if it was okay to write it in that way, to which Cheng Dale assured her that it was okay, as he was just half-joking, pointing out a few things to him as he was tolerant. The worried Liu Jihan responded that she was afraid Yang Longting would blame them, to which Cheng Dale replied that he was also tolerant. After a while, Liu Jihan passed the finished letter to the soldier to deliver it. Later that night, a voice was heard in a room moaning as she was hurt. Cheng Dale asked her if he was doing it too hard, to which the voice responded to do it softer. Cheng Dale was massaging Liu Jihan's shoulders. Zhu Shenji aggressively opened the door, telling Cheng Dale that something had happened. Cheng Dale looked at Zhu Shenji, asking him what was wrong. Zhu Shenji's eyes were wide as he informed Cheng Dale that Fuhu Mountain had been broken through. Cheng Dale was in disbelief as it had not even been a day since Yang Longting attacked. Zhu Shenji informed Cheng Dale that Yang Longting had personally led a thousand soldiers and horses, including the remnants of the army Luo Tai had originally led. Zhu Shenji informed Cheng Dale that Yang Longting had used the night to attack the village and had lured Boss Bear out of the village with a mock attack of 200 old and weak soldiers. Yang Lingting's main force had taken advantage of the fact that the village was empty and broken in, using the old and weak women and children of the hut as a shield to attack Boss Bear violently. It was reported that Boss Bear's wife and children had been killed in battle, and his men had suffered numerous casualties. He was fortunate to break out of the siege accompanied by some close friends. However, Boss Bear's whereabouts were still unknown. Cheng Dale's eyes darkened while Liu Jihan beside him couldn't care less after Zhu Shenji reported that Yang Longting had broken through the mountain in one night. From the beginning to the end of the battle in just only two hours. Shocked, Cheng Dale believed that it wouldn't take many troops to defeat the Toad Village. He ordered Kin Man to ride and retrieve his letter. Kin Man didn't hesitate and quickly ran in the middle of the night. Kin Man caught up with the messenger who was resting at the post that night. He retrieved Cheng Dale's letter and handed over a newly written letter. Kin Man clasped his hand, informing the soldier that Cheng Dale had found a spelling mistake in the letter and had asked him to come over to replace it. The soldier gave him the letter. Meanwhile, in the middle of the forest, Cheng Dale and his men were camping. Cheng Dale told them that they were going to send troops to search for Boss Bear, who had escaped into the forest. The man voiced out his opinion, telling Cheng Dale that he was 63 years old in the current year and begged not to be sent out, as he could hardly hold the sword anymore. Cheng Dale responded that if he couldn't hold his sword, he should pass it to Little Lei. Little Lei, who flexed his arms, told Cheng Dale that he was strong and could carry it for his grandpa. Kin Man chimed in and told Cheng Dale that Boss Bear could be very fierce, as he had heard in the last few days that others who had been chased by him had been killed. He was worried that if only a few of them encountered Boss Bear, they wouldn't be enough to fight him. Cheng Dale grinned and told Kin Man what he had been talking about as they hadn't had the bad luck to bump into Boss Bear. He told them that after that day's hike, they would return because the more dry food they ate, the more difficult it was to digest. Cheng Dale turned to Kin Man who was grilling his food, and told him if he could hunt some animals to improve their diet as he came from a hunting family. Kin Man smiled and responded that he couldn't hunt in the cold weather. He was alerted and noticed a bear in the nearby trees, which also made Cheng Dale turn to look at what he was talking about. The group hid in one of the bushes, and Kin Man wondered why the bear looked familiar, while Cheng Dale mumbled that all bears looked the same to him. Cheng Dale told Kin Man that it was now up to him, as he had also heard that bear paws were very complimentary. Kin Man leaped and landed on a tree as he held his spear in his hand, watching the bear. He took another leap and was about to plunge his spear behind the bear. After a while, Boss Bear's men asked him if they should look for the second master as he was still lost. Enraged, Boss Bear ordered them to look for the second master as he was almost like a brother to him. He was assured that the beast was very fierce and if someone died somewhere because of the beast, he would reveal his whereabouts. When one of Boss Bear's men noticed smoke and informed him that someone was in front of them, Boss Bear told him to be quiet. Meanwhile, in Cheng Dale's camp, they grilled the meat on top of their campfire. He complimented Kin Man, telling him that he could really do well, as it just took one hit to kill the black bear. 
Kin Man told them that the bear seemed weak, otherwise, it would not have been so easy. Cheng Dale scoffed and told Kin Man not to be so modest, as well as telling him to try the grilled bear. Despite the fact that he couldn't hunt but was a great griller, they turned to look at their side and noticed Boss Bear standing and clenching his axe. Boss Bear cried and yelled for his dead bear, while Cheng Dale's group stared him dead in the eyes. Anxious, Cheng Dale told Boss Bear that he had no idea and invited him that he could have some instead. In rage, Boss Bear with tears in his eyes screamed the name of his little brother. He yelled at Cheng Dale's group that he would take revenge for the bear as he charged towards them. Cheng Dale stood up and yelled at Boss Bear that he had been waiting for him for a long time and he was just in time. Boss Bear and his men halted. The man beside him asked what was wrong. Sweating, Boss Bear wondered if there would be an ambush. Cheng Dale grinned and told Boss Bear that by the order of Yang Longting, he had been waiting for him at the area for a long time and asked him to fight as the last time they saw each other neither of them could claim victory. Boss Bear reasoned that Cheng Dale's group must have known it was his mount as they got his bear believing that they dared to camp around the area and cooked a meal just to attract him. He gritted his teeth and claimed that there was an ambush nearby. As both groups glanced at each other, Boss Bear told Cheng Dale that he was not used to being a lapdog like him and that that day he would cut him in half. Cheng Dale stared at Boss Bear thinking if he scared him believing that if they had a fight at the moment it would be a bloody battle. He wondered if he had to use his joker. Boss Bear yelled at his men, telling them that the situation did not appear to be right and ordered them to retreat as he ran first. Agitated, Cheng Dale yelled at Boss Bear where he was going as he had to fight him for 300 rounds. Boss Bear turned to look at Cheng Dale as he was running away and laughed at him, telling him he wouldn't get ambushed by him, while Cheng Dale and his group were watching them retreat. Cheng Dale gave Kin Man a thumbs up and told him that they were going to get out of the forest. After a little while, a man asked Boss Bear where they were going, and Boss Bear responded that they were going east. He told his men that Cheng Dale thought they were going south and that he didn't know they turned around halfway, making them impossible to find. Boss Bear raised his axe and mumbled that after some time in hiding, they would occupy a mountain and eat and drink generously as they had before promising his men that he would still be a boss in three years. The man beside Boss Bear praised him. Some time later, Boss Bear and his men hiked up the mountain when he noticed something moving behind the bushes. Cheng Dale and his men appeared. Cheng Dale turned around wide-eyed as he encountered Boss Bear again. Boss Bear's face darkened, and he couldn't speak a single word. Cheng Dale pointed at him and told him that he knew Boss Bear would come. Boss Bear retreated again and quickly ran, telling Cheng Dale that he was not finished with him. Cheng Dale sighed and vented at Kin Man, asking who had led the way. Kin Man scratched his head and suggested Cheng Dale should lead instead. Cheng Dale told them that they were going back up the mountain to find the official way back to the Toad Village, as it had been dangerous in the area. Kin Man inquired if they would meet Boss Bear again, to which Cheng Dale responded that they wouldn't be that unlucky. After a little while, they arrived at a village, and Cheng Dale sighed that they had finally gotten out. The bushes beside them moved and made a noise. Boss Bear appeared, mumbling that he didn't know how many ambushers were in the mountain village as they were no longer safe in the mountains. He informed his men that they would leave the mountain in the evening and find a family to rob. Boss Bear turned his head and noticed Cheng Dale, making his face darken. Cheng Dale and Kin Man's faces also darkened as they both thought they were unlucky. He asked Boss Bear if he believed in fate. Enraged, Boss Bear asked Cheng Dale why he had bullied them so much, while the man beside him informed Boss Bear that they no longer had the strength to run away. Boss Bear raised his axe and told Cheng Dale that he hadn't seen an ambush in the area, believing that Cheng Dale must have wanted to exhaust their fighting strength so he could fight them. The man beside Boss Bear also raised their weapon and told Boss Bear that they were going to fight with them as it was nothing th. They charged at Cheng Dale's group as Boss Bear ordered them to kill them. Cheng Dale readied himself, ordering Kin Man to protect the others as he would deal with Boss Bear and his men alone. He asked the system for the fusion skills, and that all martial arts in the world must be diligently learned and practiced, that the power must be exhausted to its limit. Experience in combat is indispensable. Without 10 years of martial arts, they could not get to their essence. Fusion was a rapid method, and the martial arts fusion would consume the martial art entity of the skill book. After the fusion, Cheng Dale was able to fully use the martial arts, however he could not teach others. The system appeared, warning Cheng Dale that the level of the host was not enough, and the use of martial arts after the fusion would be a great burden on his body, she asked if he would like to continue the fusion. Cheng Dale held his sword and told the system to fuse as he charged towards Boss Bear and his men. As they charged at each other, Boss Bear's men yelled to kill Cheng Dale with everything they had. 
Cheng Dale's sword emitted a blue aura as he unleashed his speedy sword technique. The first style was straightforward, which made Cheng Dale blitz through Boss Bear. He thought that his sword was fast. After the first blow, Cheng Dale claimed that he was hurt and his wrist bone felt pain like it had been broken. Cheng Dale thought that with his current strength, he wouldn't be able to master the style perfectly as he slashed and dashed through his enemy. He believed that he could stab a maximum of seven times. Boss Bear's men were slashed, making them groan as Cheng Dale blitzed through them one by one. Cheng Dale turned as he was about to encounter Boss Bear's huge axe behind him. Cheng Dale tightly clenched his sword as he was about to deflect Boss Bear's axe. He held his sword with both of his hands and was about to thrust at him. He slashed Boss Bear, making him cough blood and thought that Cheng Dale was strong. Behind him, Cheng Dale knelt one of his legs. Kin Man and the others stood by as Cheng Dale stood firm, while Boss Bear and his men lay unconscious on the ground. Kin Man was in disbelief after just a few breaths. Cheng Dale took care of so many people before he had the chance to do anything. He asked Cheng Dale when he had learned such excellent swordplay. Cheng Dale, on his back, spoke if Kin Man thought the gods had only passed on their axe technique to him, and that he was also regarded as a first-class master as of the time. At the end of the fusion, Cheng Dale's martial arts techniques were integrated into the deep consciousness of the host. The system warned him that his body was in a high state of stress, and now he had been forced into sleep mode. Concerned, Cheng Dale's men asked what was wrong with him, as Cheng Dale fell to the ground asking them to wake up. Some time later, Cheng Dale woke up and noticed that Liu Jihan was calling him after he had opened his eyes. Bedridden, Cheng Dale called for Liu Jihan, as Liu Jihan covered her mouth in disbelief. She leaped to him and hugged him, relieved that Cheng Dale had awakened. Liu Jihan informed the villagers that Cheng Dale had now awakened. Cheng Dale petted Liu Jihan and asked Kin Man how long he had been out. Kin Man responded that he'd been out for a full day and night, as his sword style had been used in the business world and was not suitable on the battlefield. He looked at Zhu Shenji and asked him if something had happened during the time he had passed out. Zhu Shenji informed him that Yang Longting had taken away Boss Bear's body, and that Yang Longting had praised him and sent him many rewards. Curious, Cheng Dale asked Zhu Shenji what Yang Longting had sent. Zhu Shenji responded that there were 200 pieces of silver, 10 pieces of jade, 50 pieces of silk, and some furniture. Cheng Dale's face darkened, and he mumbled that Yang Longting had sent useless things. Liu Jihan looked at him and told Cheng Dale that his reputation had spread all over Yuzhu City, and now everyone knew about the Toad Village. She asked him why he still looked unhappy after that. Cheng Dale responded that if he had more power and strength, he would not have to be at others' beck and call. He brushed Liu Jihan's hair as he mumbled that he hoped Boss Bear's corpse could satisfy Yang Longting for a few days. Day after day passed, the snow melted, and everything came back to life. The construction of the village was nearing completion. At the new Toad Village, the men tried to pull the wooden bridge in front of their gate. One man yelled and informed them that the drawbridge had been raised and the gates had been installed. They were ordered to open the floodgates. A red-haired girl ordered them to get the crossbows and slingshot up the wall, as she wanted to have more crossbows on the wall. She ordered more rocks too. A system notification popped up, stating that the construction of the village was complete and the system upgrade was finished. In the morning, Cheng Dale sat alone on the balcony. He was thinking after the construction of the village had been completed. He had only been notified about a system upgrade, but not about an upgrade to a third-level village. While he held onto a scroll, he kept thinking that, therefore, there were no additional attributes of the system, only the podium for summons, residential buildings, medical center, military observation posts, warehouse, blacksmith shop, woodworking store, clothing store, and wondered what exactly was missing. A dainty hand emerged, held the scroll, and requested for her to take a look. Cheng Dale looked back and was surprised. As soon as he realized it was the system, he flushed. Cheng Dale was amazed that the system had evolved. Then he began to wonder how big she had become, to which she agreed the podium for summons. Training ground as such these were already available, and the condition of the 1,000 inhabitants was now fulfilled. The system figured out the problem as she said that there was one more item missing. A pop-out box appeared that he had a top-level character was still missing with two over three of completion. Cheng Dale thought in his mind that he did not look at anything that was not compatible with decency, and asked the system as he had been wanting to for a long time, even though it said that only he could see her. The system used to be so small, but now they were so big and that she was already a big girl, so she needed to pay attention too, 
which made the system further confused. Cheng Dale continued to say that she wore a skirt every day and flew over his head and asked her if she wasn't afraid to expose herself as he might have seen it by accident, to which the system was stunned. He had a lot to say about her not being a bully to the lottery machine, her violent tendencies, and told her to be a more polite lady, suggesting to draw ten times but couldn't guarantee him a top-level character, podium for summons, and as to why she couldn't send him a top martial artist, which could be beneficial to everyone, which made the system angry. The system punched Cheng Dale and yelled at him to die and called him a pervert. Cheng Dale was lying on the ground, and the system continued berating him for being shameless and a pervert and asked him where he had looked every day. She was really enraged with Cheng Dale. She even called him a dumbass. A few moments later, Cheng Dale asked Guan Yu if he had improved on his sword fighting training, asked Jiang about whether he felt comfortable with his snake spear, and if he felt divine power that could stop 10,000 opponents by himself, and also suggested to Lin Xiao Yu to practice with a weapon as he aspired to be a warrior. Xiao Yu replied, How could I practice when I didn't have a weapon anymore? Cheng Dale answered him to go to the blacksmith Xu and have her forge a weapon for him. He sighed, feeling dejected because it seemed impossible for anyone to level up in a short time. On the day of the awakening, the spring thunder appeared, and everything came to life. It was raining when Cheng Dale sat on the balcony with Liu Zhai, pondering where he could find the third one. She asked her village master that the village was built, yet he was still unhappy and offered to sing a little song for him. Cheng Dale agreed aimlessly and said whatever, but in his mind, he had thought that even though he had merged himself with a fast sword style, he was still only excellent. He pondered about the chances of pulling top level with 100,000 fear points at the podium for summons, and it seemed that he only had the option of accumulating a million fear points to trade for a top level character directly through the system. Liu Zhai kept singing while the rain kept pouring. She smiled while singing beautifully. Cheng Dale asked her how she knew this, to which she replied that she was able to do that before. Cheng Dale was in awe after learning it at a youth center. He placed his palm on her head and assured her that Yan Jihan was gone and she was now Liu Zhai. He added that she was his Liu Zhai. A few days later, Yang Longting raised 50,000 troops and sent them to Black Rock City. A soldier informed Yang Longting that in front of him was the toad village of Kin New Mountain, to which he acknowledged and responded that this time they would let the toad village clear the way. It was also about time to put those mountain bandits to good use. As they moved along, they were welcomed by cheerful bandits waving a red flag hoping they would enjoy their stay with them and wishing them all the best of luck and success. Meanwhile, they were stunned by the Toad Village. Yang Longting told Zhu Shenji, who was wearing a black face mask, that he intended to send the people of Kin New Mountain ahead so he could promote him later and asked what he had been doing, where he had been, and why he hadn't come out for Cheng Dale to see him. Zhu Shenji replied that his village master had been sick and unable to greet the lord in person and hoped that the king would punish him for that. Yang Longting suspected him of faking his illness as he had gotten sick at just the right time. Zhu Shenji respectfully replied that, to be honest with him, not only had the village master been sick, but there had also been many people sick in the village at the moment. Kin New Mountain had been fighting the plague right now, to which he questioned this plague. He then questioned what kind of plague it was and how come he had never heard of a plague in this area, to which Zhu Shenji responded by asking him to come closer. Yang Longting leaned closer to Zhu Shenji as he whispered to him if he had ever heard of salsa, which made him wonder. Zhu Shenji explained that it meant that once the disease broke out, it could kill anyone. Yang Longting simply stared at him while pondering the fact that it had not been a coincidence that just when he had wanted to use him, he had gotten sick. However, if he were to become infected, his 50,000-man army could collapse in a day. He then demanded that Zhu Shenji inform Cheng Dale to come to him on the spot immediately, and Zhu Shenji replied that his village master had been infected with the plague. But he also threatened that if Cheng Dale did not come to him, he should not blame him for cleaning the people of Kin New Mountain first. Unsteady steps were heard calling out for Yang Longting, who was referred to as my lord. Cheng Dale, who was shaky and fragile, arrived while being carried out by another bandit while he sobbed, begging his village master to hold on. Cheng Dale informed Yang Longting that he had come to visit him. Yang Longting asked him if he had been really sick. Cheng Dale coughed as he denied that he had not been sick and claimed to have been in good health. He had prepared his armor and accompanied the lord on his journey to repay his kindness. Yang Longting advised him to get treatment if he had been sick, adding that it had never been too late to protect his family and country when he would be well again. He instructed to call for a military doctor to treat General Cheng, to which the military doctor complied. The military doctor checked Cheng Dale's eye and told him to stick his tongue out a little, which he obeyed. 
Yang Longton asked if he had been really sick. The military doctor replied to his majesty that General Cheng's body had been cold and his pulmonary veins had been injured. If not treated in time, his life would have been in danger. Yang Longton demanded to call another military doctor again and cited how a charlatan could have cured his general's illness. Then he thought in his mind if he had been really infected with the plague and wondered if he had accused him wrongly. Another military doctor checked Cheng Dalei. He also told his majesty. After a discussion, the three of the military doctors agreed that he had been seriously ill. Despite being visibly weak and coughing, Cheng Dalei insisted that he had not been sick and he would have killed the enemy and served the king. Later on, Yang Longting gave in and told Cheng Dalei if he had been sick, he needed to get better and later he would have a chance to prove himself. Then he thought in his mind, he had had the plague and still wanted to join his army and wondered if he had wanted to kill him. The 50,000-strong Yuzhu army departed on horses. Cheng Dalei waved them goodbye as he stood behind, telling them they must have triumphed in one fell swoop and swept everything away, even though he couldn't have accompanied them. The ability of his village master to pretend as sick while the three doctors had missed it astounded Zhu Shenji, who thought it had been awesome, but found it really scary. A snotty-nosed Cheng Dalei claimed that he had soaked himself in the river for three days before developing a cold. He had already been sick, and his life hadn't been easy, to which Zhu Shenji responded with the remark that he had been really sick. Zhu Shenji helped him to hold on with him, which Cheng Dalei instructed to bring him to Huang Sanyuan later, for he had to give him an order. Zhu Shenji asked what had to be done that only butler Huang could do, to which Cheng Dalei replied that he wanted him to go to Black Rock City, meet with Zhu Banchuan, and tell him that they had wanted to work with him. Fast forward, Huang Sanyuan was escorted by Zhao Zilong to bypass the army and take a shortcut, faster than the Yuzhu army, and got to Black Rock City. After traveling a long way, they managed to sneak into Black Rock City. Butler Huang told General Liu that he had had an important request to see the city lord Zhu and that it was a matter of life and death. They went inside, and General Liu called his adoptive father, informing him that someone from the Toad Village had come. City Lord Zhu Banchuan was seated while riding. Butler Huang marveled at what an extraordinary person he was, thinking that even under the pressure of the advancing army, he had been able to read and write so calmly. He then extended his fist wrapped in greeting and told City Lord Zhu that he had risked his life to come to him on the village master's order to discuss an important matter that could have resulted in death. But he was interrupted by Zhu Banchuan and questioned about the cooperation when he was about to surrender. In fact, he had been writing the surrender letter right then, admitting that he had been a guilty minister and would kneel down a hundred times. Butler Huang was floored and asked City Lord Zhu how his soul would have been able to take it. City Lord Zhu coughed as he replied that he could have managed to hang in there. He was shocked when he realized that Butler Huang had come to side with him against the Lord of Yuzhu. He added that if he captured him and offered him to the Lord of Yuzhu, perhaps he would have been spared, which left Butler Huang speechless. Butler Huang sat down with him and inquired when City Lord Zhu had become like that. He used to be aggressive, no matter what bad things happened, he handled everything with plans and strategies. He added that the way he looked that day had been a little scary. City Lord Zhu sighed when he told him that although this matter should remain secret, he couldn't live comfortably there for much longer. He would discuss this with him in detail. At the time, before he had gotten rid of Han Huju, he realized through espionage that Yang Longting had joined the same army with Han Huju in his youth. They had led the remnants of the army and fought a bloody battle with the rings and later became famous. But with that alone, he could not become the lord of Yuzhu, and his wealth still depended on his wife, Kyuishi. His wife Kyuishi had belonged to a powerful family in the capital, which had a lot of power and influence. Han Huju seemed to have offended the Kyui family at the time. In order to have a good relationship with the Kyui family, Yang Longting resolutely broke friendship with him. Yang Longting even took away Han Huju's credit at the award ceremony in the capital because he had been manipulated by the Kyui family. After being recognized by the Kyui family, Yang Longting was appointed Lord of Yuzhu, while Han Huju was only the Lord of Black Rock City. The incident caused a complete rift between the two, and they never got back together for the next 30 years. But the problem was that the relationship between them had not been broken at all. Zhu Banchuan had misjudged the brotherhood between them. He had not thought that his power could be so great, which had led to the current situation. Moments later, Butler Huang told him that he was afraid the King of Yuzhu might not accept his surrender. City Lord Zhu replied that he knew the planning was in the hands of the people after all. As long as their safety was guaranteed, they would force him to write a surrender. Maybe the King of Yuzhu would let him go too. Butler Huang responded that he had time to write a surrender letter and why didn't he use their motivation to deter him. City Lord Zhu pondered how and with what he would deter him. 
He had his own people serving in the army and as officials, and he simply needed to send a message to have many powerful families report to him. He could do nothing more than wait for the army to invade so that he could open the gate to surrender. He went on to say that he had planned to take Black Rock City as his foundation, and although he might not end up being a powerful lord in the future, he had become completely exhausted from ruling Black Rock City, and his ambition was also gone. Butler Huang replied that his village master had asked him to bring a message to the city lord, which made him wonder what Cheng Dalei had said. People would have died if they had gotten their heads down, but they might have lived if they had fought back. City Lord Zhu repeated what had been said to get their heads down and fight back, and responded to Butler Huang, asking him to talk more about it. A soldier in a carriage informed General Liu that the Toad Village was ahead, which he questioned if he needed to remind him of it. Seated on top of sacks, General Liu said his adoptive father didn't want to train him. Why wouldn't he be with the grain carriers and have to deal with this group of mountain bandits? To which the soldier controlling the horse replied that the Toad Village had recently been recruited and was therefore considered their allies. General Luo questioned whether they truly stuck into other people's affairs and were also expected to treat them equally questioning what the big deal was. The soldier advised General Liu that he could not say that later. When they arrived at Toad Village, the military strategist said they could not pick a fight with them now. Suddenly, the soldier received a swift kick to the head. General Luo questioned whether they took the military strategist's words seriously when he was a piece of shit in his eyes. He might as well think of a way to destroy Toad Village to eliminate a major problem for his adoptive father, then perhaps he would be able to rejoin him. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale was informed that it was time for him to take his medication. While Liu Jai handed him a bowl of his medication, he was lying on his bed coughing and telling her it was bad luck to say anything like that. Suddenly, Zhu Shenji stormed into the room and informed his village master that the grain transporters from Yuzhu had run into trouble with some of their people. In response to Cheng Dalei's request for help, Liu Jai objected since her village master was still ill. Cheng Dalei criticized how anything could go wrong during this procedure and gave the order to take him there immediately and bring his sword. A few moments later, someone threw a jar to the ground and moaned that the wine was worse than horse poop. It was General Luo who complained about how they were treated and demanded that he get out. A bandit explained to him that the village master was not feeling well, to which General Luo did not care if he was alive or dead, and insisted for him to get Cheng Dale out. Cheng Dale, with Liu Jai, appeared behind and asked if he was General Luo and what it was about his staff that bothered him. General Luo acknowledged Cheng Dale and realized that he was actually a sickly bastard. He then explained to him that he needed to realize that he was a mountain bandit, and that his adoptive father had made him what he was. If he did not understand how to appreciate his adoptive father's favor, he could promote and discard him at any time, to which Cheng Dale responded that he was well aware of this fact. General Luo reached for a jar of wine and questioned whether it was something his people could drink or whether this was the only thing his village could serve him. Cheng Dale slightly bowed his head, then laughed and said that he would be coming back with another great wine to entertain General Luo. General Luo responded that he wanted to drink this jar of wine, to which Cheng Dale politely denied because he was suffering from a cold and could not drink wine. General Luo poured the wine on Cheng Dale's head and reminded him to remember this well. Not showing respect to him was like not showing respect to the Lord of Yuzhu. This shocked Liu Jai. General Luo kept saying that he wanted him to drink all the wine in this jug until there was not a drop left. The bandits were surprised to see their village master had to go through this. General Luo, who wanted him to get angry, mockingly responded to the entire jar of wine that Cheng Dale did not want to drink, which was spilled on the floor, thinking that if he lost control, he could go to his adoptive father to gather up troops and destroy him. Even though he was dripping wet, Cheng Dale maintained his composure. Liu Jai offered to drink it for her village master. General Luo grinned as he reached for his sword, wondering where this little nanny came from. He continued drawing his sword swiftly while questioning what she was that she deserved to drink it. He then swung his sword in Lai Zhu's direction, shocking her. General Liu's sword was suddenly blocked by another sword, which caused a metallic clattering sound and successfully moved it further away. It was Cheng Dale who blocked his attack. Cheng Dale furiously stared at him. After General Liu told Cheng Dale that he needed to control his dog and not let her bark because his fast sword did not recognize the dog owner, General Liu grinned and thought in his mind that Cheng Dale was finally angry. If he had known this earlier, he would have killed the little girl long ago to make him even angrier. In response, Cheng Dale said he would discipline his people, but what about him? He called him a little dog who didn't have someone to control him. General Luo reached for his inside pocket and replied that he was holding a sword, laughing, 
and daring him to hold a sword in front of him. He then threw some copper plates and added that he also had a fast sword that could cut through copper plates with one swing. Suddenly, General Luo rapidly split the copper plates in half and then told him that if he could do the same with the copper plates, the matter would be settled for today. Cheng Dalei responded that his sword was not for cutting copper plates, to which General Luo sarcastically asked what else he used it for and guessed it was for cutting radishes. Cheng Dalei replied that it was for killing people. He then abruptly approached him, slicing his sword numerous times in a short period of time, and unexpectedly stopped behind him. General Luo froze in awe. After stating that there was such a swift sword in the world, blood began to trickle from him as he progressively lost his footing. Screaming for their General Luo, the grain transport soldiers were startled. Even the bandits were taken aback, and Cheng Dale asked them what they were looking forward to before informing everyone that it was time to get to work. As the grain-carrying soldiers fled, their boots clattered loudly. Outside the Toad Village, however, they were pursued by bandits with weapons. The grain-carrier soldiers of Yuzhu pleaded with General Cheng to talk, as they did not want to fight him. He responded by telling them to put down their weapons, take off their leather armor, leave the grain carts there, and they could go. The soldiers were shocked and terrified, thinking that if the Lord of Yuzhu discovered that their grain carriage had vanished, he would have them behead them. Cheng Dalei told them they should take Luo Tai's body with them. He then fiercely said to send a message to the Lord of Yuzhu that Luo Tai was beheaded by Cheng for not obeying the law. Yang Longting's army fought its way to Black Rock City and set up camp 10 miles from the city. The soldiers were divided into four groups to prevent the people of Black Rock City from escaping by surrounding them. His grain carrier soldiers arrived at the army camp of Yuzhu and bowed down while addressing their lord of Yuzhu. Yang Longting was given the blood-stained corpse of General Luo, who had been slain by Cheng Dale after complaining about the wine's quality. The soldier then told him to deliver a message that Luo Tai had been beheaded by Cheng for not obeying the law. Yang Longting responded to the loss of grain transport. He immediately ordered them to be executed by cutting their heads off. Then Yang Longting composed a letter and gave the order to have it delivered to Toad Village. He angrily thought of Cheng Dale. It was written on the letter, asking him if he was not afraid of death. Cheng Dale chuckled when he read the letter. He grabbed his ink brush and wrote, If you want to fight, then come and fight. Angrily, the paper was slapped upon the table. After reading the return letter, Yang Longting yelled Cheng Dale's name furiously. Inside a war room, Yang Longting told everyone to listen and asked who wanted to lead 5,000 soldiers with him to destroy Toad Village. A general responded to his majesty, saying he would leave this matter to him and was confident that he would definitely fulfill this mission. However, his military strategist voiced that he would not suggest this. Now the army had just set up camp, and if they returned now to attack Cheng Dale, Zhu Banchuan might take this opportunity to attack them from behind. He went on to say that they would find themselves in a situation where their backs were against the wall, which would be a big military mistake. Besides, he still had their grain routes in his hand. If he cut them off, their 50,000-strong army would be in a desperate situation. His general respectfully chimed in, suggesting to his majesty that they should first leave this bandit alone, and when they successfully besieged Black Rock City, they could get rid of this bandit on the way back. Yang Longting was told to calm down while he was left speechless. He clenched his fist, crumpling the letter, and instructed to call the servants. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village, it was daytime when Cheng Dale was informed that another letter had arrived from the Lord of Yuzhu. Liu Zhai inquired of her village master what the King of Yuzhu had said. Cheng Dale sat with the letter in both his hands and responded that it said he knew Cheng Dale had killed Luo Tai and praised him for a good and fantastic job. The grains were provided for them, and it would be better if he could come to them for the siege. Cheng Dale smiled when he thought that Yan Longting was really adaptable to circumstances. He was worthy of being the Lord of Yuzhou. He then instructed Liu Zhai to have the pen and paper ready as they would be getting ready to kiss his ass. Alongside Cheng Dale, Liu Zhai sat down and began to pen the words that praise the light that shines in the north, the backbone of the empire, His Majesty the Lord of Yuzhou whom he would always revere. Moments later at the army camp of Yuzhu, after receiving his letter, he had everyone in the hut read it together. All of them were convinced of his wisdom, and many of them wiped the tears from their faces because they felt this letter was glorious. Inside the letter, Cheng Dalai expressed his desire to serve alongside the king, but he was too ill to leave his bed, so he could only pray for him in his heart and wished him success. He signed off as your faithful little fellow, the eternal admirer of the King of Yuzhu, from the Trap Battalion of Kin New Mountain in Yuzhu, his ranger General Cheng Dale.
Yang Longting thought in his mind that this bandit and his flattering words, behaviors, and the letters he wrote to Yuzhu City were similar to all the other scoundrels in the city who were good at kissing asses and being opportunistic. Everyone, including him, thought this little bandit was a joke. He genuinely underestimated Cheng Dale, thinking perhaps he was someone who was more worth as a target than Zhu Banchuan. He used his tableside candlelight to burn the letter, and he didn't care too much about it at this point because his first priority was invading the city after first appeasing the small bandit. It was nighttime at the city mansion of Black Rock City. City Lord Zhu Banchuan, alongside his armed soldiers and captured citizens on their knees, told them that the so-called siege of the city seemed to be still absent. However, Yang Longting's army surrounded Black Rock City. He kept talking to everyone. Yang Longting was not a man of his word. He was going to kill them all but do not be afraid, for he would protect them all. A captured citizen questioned his protection when he captured them all right now and advised the city lord Zhu to give up and surrender early. Maybe there would still be a chance for him to get out alive. The captured citizen replied that only he would not survive when the lord of Yuzhu broke through the city. City lord Zhu sat in front of them and questioned what else he was fantasizing about. Given that everything had been sealed from the outside, and it was obvious they did not even have a chance to escape. They advised him to release them as soon as possible and could also assist him in pleading for mercy. But Zhu Banchuan questioned his goodness because he was aware that the man had made a bargain for his own children and that he intended to sell him in exchange for the position of city lord. He felt safe and brave and went to the Hongmen banquet. City lord Zhu added that he did a little work when he invited them over for dinner. He sent someone to hide an envelope there and sarcastically assured them not to worry about the letter. It was hidden quite well, so it was not easy to find. The fake envelopes had been clearly arranged for them, and a few years before, he found out that the king of Yuzhu had some secrets that were not known. City Lord Zhu grinned when he kept saying. It included how he became the Lord of Yuzhu and where he was wounded during the war, which prevented him from having children, and it was all written clearly in the letter. The captured citizens were shocked and terrified when City Lord Zhu kept teasing them if they thought that he would tell them everything before he would be beheaded. In the future, they would all live in the mansion of the City Lord. When they should stay alive, they stayed alive together, and when they should die, they died together. City Lord Zhu added. Fast forward, it was daytime when someone claimed that these opportunists, willing to trade their loyalty in exchange for fame and fortune of their entire family, had been dealt with, along with the procrastinators. Butler Huang asked City Lord Zhu how long they could hold the city this time, to which he replied that they should rely on themselves for as long as they could because there was no turning back. City Lord Zhu continued to say that the Black Rock City only had 5,000 soldiers, adding that if they were to be marginalized, then all 100,000 residents would be treated as soldiers. If Yang Longting couldn't bear the loss of his troops and retreated, he would be able to make a name for himself. If he couldn't bear it, it was just a death and nothing more. He asked Butler Huang how the preparations were going on their side. Butler Huang replied that it was pretty successful, and the people were withdrawn but worried if his village master's plan could work. City Lord Zhu responded it should work if he put his heart into it. In a certain place, a few men were chatting about how Yan Longting was not a good person. They said he was horny as hell, that all the women in his family, including a child, his older or younger sister, and ants were not spared, and that he was one hell of a perverted person. Yan Longting also grew up with an excessive lust for sex which he couldn't restrain as an adult and watched his wife sleep with other men to satisfy himself. Many individuals were discussing Yan Longting. Rumors were spreading. It eventually spread throughout the Black Rock City and reached the barracks outside the city. Soldiers from Yuzhu were whispering. Yang Longting continued to sit inside his hut. He was furious when he thought of Zhu Si, which was City Lord Zhu Banchuan's nickname. A red flag was waving while chanting to attack the city. His soldiers blew their horns. At dawn, Yang Longting began to attack the city. The Yuzhu army advanced towards the Black Rock City, raising their red flags while screaming to kill them. With the intention of killing, they made their way to the wall, and then climbed up ladders. A Black Rock City soldier yelled that they needed to defend this area, and prevent others from climbing there and killing them. Soldiers occasionally fell down the ladder as they screamed. The Black Rock City remained unfazed, while at the Yuzhu camp at night, where its soldiers were currently being treated. Inside the hut, Yang Longting discussed with his military strategist that the previous day's attack was just a feint, as the defense of four walls would always have a weak side. He instructed his military strategist that he would lead the 1st Regiment with 10,000 soldiers to surround the East Gate, and Kai DeLong would lead the 2nd Regiment of soldiers to surround the West Gate. Kai Deking would lead the 3rd Regiment of 10,000 soldiers to surround the North Gate. 
while Yang Longting went on to say that he would lead the main force with 20,000 soldiers to attack the South Gate since Zhu Xi was a bit capable. The Black Rock City was built like an iron barrel, and it was hard to use the secret spies he had planted there. The Lord of Yuzhu was informed by a soldier that a letter had arrived from the Qin Niu Mountain side. It caught the attention of Yang Longting, while the military strategist felt annoyed and wondered what Cheng Dale was up to again. A day ago, on the mountain path of Qin Niu Mountain, inside the carriage, Xiao Yi asked Miss Su Ying. Despite the famine being just over, the hilly fish business was just starting up again. Yet she wondered why Cheng Dale now wanted the entire Su family to move to Toad Village. Miss Su Ying explained that Yuzhu City and Black Rock City were fighting each other, and in a year of military chaos, staying alive was more important than anything else, and it was hard to be a wealthy family member in peace. Xiao Yi doubted that the little Toad Village could support hundreds of members of the Su family. Their carriages kept moving when Xiao Yi was in awe and asked what this place was and instructed her to look at it. Miss Su was left speechless. As they passed through the high-walled stone gate, she wondered when the Toad Village had become so big. Meanwhile, it was nighttime on the official road of Kin New Mountain. The grain carrier soldiers were instructed to freeze. The mountain bandits screamed that this mountain path had been made by them and that they had also planted the trees. The grain carrier soldiers were startled when the bandits demanded that they leave their money if they wanted to pass. Cheng Dale, with his axe resting on his shoulder, warned them that otherwise, they would have their teeth knocked out and be buried alive without being killed. The soldier innocently laughed at him, continued to address him as General Cheng, and inquired whether or not he was joking because he hadn't done this in a while and wanted to have fun, which he thought was quite amusing. Cheng Dale explained that he was robbing them right now and wondered if they understood. The soldier was confused because Cheng Dale cheekily responded that he had quit after he had already submitted to the Lord of Yuzhou. Cheng Dale smiled and agreed when the soldier asked if he had simply decided on the spot. With delight, Cheng Dale assured them that he wouldn't treat them harshly and that the Toad Village's rule called for 20% of the grain. The soldier asked him if he wasn't afraid of dying and expressed outrage at how he dared to apply this rule to the Lord of Yuzhou. Cheng Dale leaned closer and stared at him, referred to him as a friend, and promised to be honest with him. He was only going to take 20% of the grain from him, then pretend nothing had happened. He reminded the grain carrier soldier that he should know that the people who had not brought the grain last time had been beheaded by the Lord of Yuzhou and questioned whether he wanted to bang his head against the king's sword. Then he threatened the soldier, asking if he would prefer to run into his axe, leaving the soldier speechless. The grain carrier soldier gave in 20% of the grains and left. Cheng Dale waved goodbye as he stood behind and reminded them not to forget to deliver the letter to the Lord of Yuzhou. A few moments later, a letter was opened with the words I quit written on it. It was Yang Longting who was furious after reading it while tightly holding the letter. He was enraged. He ripped the letter and ordered Kai Delong to take command of 10,000 soldiers and bring him Cheng Dale's head in three days. Kai Delong replied with his fist clenched, indicating that he understood. The next day he led the 10,000 soldiers and went directly to the Flying Tiger Village. Cheng Dale constantly met with Kai Delong in the Flying Tiger Village and actually made Kai Delong believe that the Flying Tiger Village had become the base camp of the Toad Village. His soldier informed him that all people here had run away, and they seemed to have retreated in an orderly manner and had taken everything with them because everything was empty. Kai Delong thought in his mind that it would not be easy to run away, and instructed his troops to go after them because they must kill them all. The scouts who were sent ahead said that all the villages in the Kin New Mountain were empty and Kai Delong wondered where they had gone. The army followed the traces to catch up with them and finally, all the traces pointed toward a valley. The 10,000 soldiers of Yuzhu army were stationed in front of the new Toad village when they arrived. As his soldier questioned whether they would still attack the city even though they lacked siege equipment, Kai Delong was astounded and wondered when there had become such a big city there with a wall that appeared to be harder to breach than the Black Rock City. Kai Delong responded to give it a try. It was daytime when Kai Delong ordered all troops to charge and kill them while they mounted the ladders on the wall. Meanwhile, Blacksmith Zhu fired the crossbows and slings. The gigantic rock was launched into the air and fell on the soldiers, breaking their ladders. Their soldier went down and fell from the ladder as the gigantic stone started crashing on them. While riding his horse, Kai Delong observed his soldiers' screams as they were struck. He was shocked and terrified, wondering what kind of city defense mechanism that was. When he realized they had slingshots and crossbows, and that he could not take the Toad Village with 10,000 ordinary soldiers, Kai Delong ordered them to retreat. On top of the gate, Liu Bei asked his village master whether they should leave the village and pursue them since they had retreated, to which Cheng Dale replied that they would not leave. He was showing weakness to bait them. 
He then added that he was the one in a hurry so they would just hold him off. Kai Delong was stationed near the village for 10 days but could not fight a real battle with Cheng Dalei. Whether pretending to retreat or showing weakness to draw the enemy in, Cheng Dalei just wouldn't come out, and he did not have a siege engine to lay siege to the city. Simply attacking would have been a nightmare. The soldiers were launching a covert attack, therefore, they had to move quickly to breach a small defense gap and approach the stronghold covertly while being warned not to fire arrows. Unluckily, the toad bandits were aware of this and cleared their throat loudly enough for the soldier to hear. The twin bandits grinned when he urged them to give them a taste of the golden juice. The soldiers screamed. The ground had a muddy-like texture that would suck in a shovel. The soldiers, too, were trapped and sucked into the mud, while one of them said that they had to manage to get in change their clothes, and blend in with them. He continued, unaware that a man was standing behind them, that if they managed to invade the city tomorrow and open the gates, that would be a big success for them. Gao Fei who came to the conclusion that his village master had the ability to predict events far in the future after witnessing the soldier shocking sneak attack and subsequent tunnel attack. He stated that every 10 steps on a post, every 5 steps a guard, he also thought of a password and questioned them if they thought that a few little rats like them could have sneaked in. He laid his sword tip on his neck and ordered these gentlemen to come with him. A few moments later, he stood on the top of the gate wall, and Cheng Dalei was asked why he conspired against him when the Lord had treated him well. Kai Delong added if he still had a sense of honor, then urged him to come out of the village quickly to fight with him and questioned what kind of hero he was if he could only hide in the village. Cheng Dale replied that their friendship was worth more than a thousand gold. He didn't want to fight with him, and reminded him of the time they talked by candlelight at night where he said he would travel far away, and he would find a girl for him. He went on to say that they became good friends when they first met, even though they were not really brothers but considered as one, and he did not expect to cross swords with him. Kai DeLong uttered that it was bullshit and he did not care about him. Cheng Dale questioned why he was trying to avoid this again. He could still remember their gathering in which he said Yang Longting was a person who could do nothing but eat and drink, and that it would be so much better if he became the Lord of Yuzhou. Cheng Dalei suggested he take Yang Longting's head, and he would make him the Lord of Yuzhou, which made Kai Delong surprised and terrified. Kai Delong sweated profusely when he thought in his mind, if the King of Yuzhou found out about this, not to mention whether he believed it or not, he would certainly feel uncomfortable, and his future would be ruined. On the other hand, Cheng Dalei himself came forward to say this. He continued thinking that if he forbade the soldiers from spreading, it would look like he was hiding something. Since he wouldn't come out to fight, he would let the soldiers escort the Grain Brigade at the Kin Niu Mountain. He kept thinking he would take some of his men to fight Black Rock City and pursue this issue later on. Eventually, Kai Delong abandoned the attack on Toad Village, leaving only 3,000 troops stationed along the main grain transportation route. However, the grain transport route was too long and therefore could not be fully secured, and Cheng Dalei's bandits were familiar with the environment, conducting night raids, fires, and traps. He led a group of people to transport, whatever could be robbed was robbed, and whatever couldn't be robbed was burned, and they never fought head-on. As soon as they encountered a larger force, they immediately fled back to the village. Someone sighed as he questioned when transporting ten wagons of grain, at least three wagons would be lost. It was Cheng Dale, saying that they should have followed the Toad Village's rules right from the beginning and given him 20% of the grain, as he stood in front of high stacks of grain. Meanwhile, on the Black Rock City side, the siege still continued. Inside the hut of Yuzhu camp, they were reporting to Yang Longting. Kai Delong reported that Cheng Dale had now blocked the grain channel. Another soldier chimed in that they had encountered a variety of attacks but had difficulty setting the tune with one beat of a gong. Kai Deking reported a young martial artist with amazing fighting skills, and the military strategist said that they had been too careless with this person, otherwise, they would have taken down Toad Village before coming there. This left Yang Longting speechless. A voice emerged, saying that it was not too late. It was Yang Longting who commanded them to notify the entire army that they would be leaving camp the next day. He remarked to kill the Toad first, then kill Zhu Si. The next day, 50,000 troops were sent to Toad Village. The soldiers of Black Rock City were confused because the Yuzhu army had withdrawn. On the top of the stone wall gate, Lu Heng questioned his adoptive father if they had been successful in driving them away because they had withdrawn their men. City Lord Zhu responded that Yang Longting would not retreat so easily, they would fight the Toad Village. Lu Heng replied asking what they should do next. City Lord Zhu said that if one of two interdependent things falls, the other would be in danger, which means that when the Toad was dead, they were next. 
He then instructed Liu Hang to take 1,000 light cavalry, prepare bows, arrows, and set out to lure the enemy. He added to show them a call to fight, the more noise, the better. A throng of noisy soldiers on horse galloped outside the Black Rock City, and City Lord Zhu watched them from atop. These soldiers successfully attracted the attention of the Yuzhu army by enticing it to join them in battle. Yang Longting smiled when they saw the Black Rock City soldiers were out, and that finally they could slaughter some lives. When the Yuzhu army straightened its rear formation and was ready to attack, with the swiftness of his light cavalry, Liu Heng dashed back to Black Rock City. When the light cavalries quickly returned to the gate and shut it, Yang Longting was rendered speechless. Pai Delong asked His Majesty what to do now, and dismayed, Yang Longton instructed to further withdraw from the palace. With further withdrawal from the place, Liu Heng grinned when they came out again with a thousand light horsemen and shot arrows. It was nighttime at the Yuzhu camp. Yang Longting kept thinking and realized Cheng Dale and Zhu Banchuan had been working together in some way or they wouldn't have cooperated so well. The mountain roads to Toad Village were mostly canyons, which were not suitable for combat. And if he stubbornly attacked the Toad Village now, he was afraid they would be pulled halfway back and forth, which would tire out the troops. He had spent half of his life in the military, and it was the first time he had encountered such vile enemies as Cheng Dale, together with Zhu Banchuan. It felt like he was trapped in a swamp, as if he was being suffocated. He went on thinking he could no longer be guided by any side. He could only bet everything on a single throw, and he must destroy the city as soon as possible. Yang Longton was stuck in a difficult situation between Black Rock City and Kin New Mountain. If he continued to attack Black Rock, he could only attack persistently. If he retreated from the camp to attack Toad Village, he could be easily attacked from the front and back. He finally decided to attack Black Rock City by force, and the battle lasted two months. Two months later, Yang Longting was terribly fatigued, and everyone was nervous. Zhu Banchua's city was almost out of food, and no one knew if they could keep it up. Cheng Dale's side had plenty of stocks. A grain carrier bandit asked his village master if they would keep robbing grain because they wouldn't fit any more in the granary, and he was afraid the food would go bad with the humid weather. Cheng Dale grinned when he caved in and told everyone to take a few days off and eat some good meals. The mountain bandits of Toad Village had gained weight overall. Meanwhile, it was raining on Kin New Mountain when Cheng Dale was informed that many soldiers from Black Rock City had arrived. Cheng Dale perched on top of the edge, wondering what had happened. There were so many defeated soldiers, and did that mean Zhu Banchuan had driven Yang Longting into defeat? Dao Fei who questioned whether they ought to continue robbing the people, to which Cheng Dale replied that something was wrong because they weren't just soldiers from Yuzhu City but also from Black Rock City. He instructed them to head back to the village and send someone to keep an eye on them all the time, and that the defeated Yang Longting might take his anger out on them. A stream of defeated soldiers passed by like an ant colony. Soldiers on horseback and on foot moved slowly, soaking wet in the rain. On the other hand, a horse was making its way towards Toad Village and was making frantic calls for their village master. They recognized it was Butler Huang and Sai Long, commanded to open the gate. Butler Huang alerted his village master that something terrible had happened while Sai Long, and he were both drenched in blood. Terrified, Butler Huang yelled that the rings were coming. The soldiers of Yuzhu fought at Black Rock City. It was a bitter struggle for two months. From the far north, 10,000 sons and daughters of the northern barbarians came south. The Yuzhu army was crushed in one day. The Black Rock City was broken through in half a day. After that, they slaughtered the city for 10 days without stopping, leaving behind a mountain of victims, severed heads hanging from tree branches, and birds swooping around. It was a gloomy day at the Black Rock City. A northern ring man on horseback led a group of captured civilians who had been turned into slaves through a series of rope ties on their hands while walking barefoot. Suddenly, the people behind the slave were startled and scared when an arrow flew straight to his throat. The northern ring man shouted furiously at Kaime while riding his horse, telling him that these people were his slaves and threatening to kill them. Kaime responded that he had stolen too much and asked if he could take them back, promising to take care of it for him. Kaime was the son of the king of the Northern Ring tribe. He continued to frighten the slaves behind him by shooting his arrow at them. Kaime had offended the Northern Ring man, who was riding a horse, and he threatened to fight him if he did not return his slave. A few moments later, some members of the Northern Barbarian began laughing at Fu Delay and questioned how he could possibly be a warrior for the tribe if he did not even dare to kill people. Fu Delay on horseback ignored them and told them to keep up with him while stuttering. He was Kai Mei's little brother, Fu Delay. Fu Delay was then told to keep up with him and labeled a coward. In response, he insisted that he was not a coward. 
he rode his horse, causing a loud thud, passing through where heads hung from tree branches. The Black Rock City was burning and being slaughtered. Fu Delay thought in his mind that they were all killing and robbing. Some envied them that they could not dare to do that and feel happy while he himself could not. This time the battle had just begun, and he wondered how long it would take. He wanted to go home and drink grandma's milk tea and wondered about Wu Li Hen and what she was doing right now. Butler Huang reported to Cheng Dalei that 10,000 people from the rings had infiltrated the city in half a day, and the situation had become chaotic. Amongst 10,000 soldiers, they managed to escape thanks to Zhao's skills, and Cheng Dalei inquired whether Zhu Banchuan was still alive. Butler Huang firmly responded that everyone was already dead because the rings had executed him as soon as they breached into the city. Cheng Dalei inquired about Yang Longting's whereabouts, whether or not he was dead, and Butler Huang responded that he was probably not dead. He had heard on the way that Yang Longting escaped and he might still be alive now. Cheng Dalei added that this old man was very fierce. He had led 50,000 elite troops and questioned how Yang Longting could be so weak in front of the Ring tribes. He couldn't defeat Black Rock City in two months, yet the Rings did it in half a day. He wondered if they were heavenly soldiers coming to Earth. Cheng Dalei was left dumbfounded when Butler Huang informed his tribe that they were talking about the Rings. The Toad Bandits were talking about the Ring tribe when they claimed to have been the ones to invade and defeat the Empire in the past forcing even the imperial majesty to abandon the city. Cheng Dalei thought to himself that this ring tribe appeared to be troublesome and questioned if they were really unbeatable. The next day, Gao Fei who respectfully asked his village master where to go. Cheng Dalei contemplated possible places they could have gone. The toad bandits continued to chatter and expressed fear that if the rings were dissatisfied with their occupation of Black Rock City and desired to go farther south, they might flee south to avoid the rings. If the rings pursued them, they might take the mountain and dominate it. In a room full of bandits with Cheng Dalei seated in front of them, one bandit said that while the young could survive, what about the children and the elderly? Another suggested that they should cross the sea since the ring tribe could do nothing to stop them. Cheng Dalei was left speechless by their comments. Gao Fei who inquired of his village master what he had in mind and whether he could tell them. After a brief period of silence, Cheng Dalei asked if it was possible for them to stay put rather than run away. Liu Bei questioned his village master about what he meant by wanting to fight in combat with the rings that had terrified the bandits. The toad bandits were terrified and furious that it would fail completely. Not even 50,000 soldiers could have stopped them. They reasoned that they shouldn't have fought in the ring when they could have fled and even asked their toad master whether they wanted to die altogether. They were ordered to be silent by Cheng Dalei. As he rose up, he reminded them that he was still the village chief and argued that it was too early for them to have treated him disrespectfully. The toad bandits were rendered silent. Cheng Dalei clarified that he hadn't said they had to defend themselves or flee. He had just said that they might have done so if they had had their backs to the enemy's iron horsemen, in which case 1 to 2,000 out of 5,000 would have been lucky. The village terrain was simple to defend yet difficult to attack, and as long as they held on to the gate, not even tens of thousands of horses and men could have breached it, according to Cheng Dalei who went on to explain how they would have protected themselves. Second, cavalry would have had a difficult time navigating the highlands, thus weakening the ring tribe's advantage. Third, their village had countless supplies that would have lasted for a year and a half, but the ring tribe lacked logistical support, and without food, they would have inevitably scattered. Of course, if they had defended themselves to the very end, they would have had to make a lot of sacrifices, but he believed that given all three conditions previously mentioned, it would not have been impossible to defend. Since Cheng Dalei was not someone who issued orders by himself and this decision would have affected the lives of more than 5,000 people, it was only natural to discuss it together. Then, he raised his fist, telling them to raise their hands if they were ready to fight. The toad bandits avoided making eye contact and kept silent. Cheng Dalei thought with his mind that no one had dared to fight the rings and questioned whether they were actually so terrifying. Suddenly, a hand was raised, it was Xiao Yu. A few moments later, someone began singing beneath the dark clouds. Kai Mei ordered someone to continue singing and playing since he enjoyed hearing someone play. At the door, it was Fu Delay who then inquired of his brother as to how long they had to stay there. Kai Mei responded that they had been waiting for the tribe to bring back the slaves and supplies, asking whether he had been getting bored, to which Fu Delay replied to his brother that he had been missing grandma. He had held his shoulder when Kai Mei had asked if he had missed her or his Wu Li Hun. Kai Mei explained that Wu Li Hun had been the most beautiful horse in the meadow, and only a lion-like man had been worthy of her. He then asked Fu Delay how many people he had killed that time and how many slaves he had acquired. 
Fudele stammered in response. Jaime was interrupted by his brother, who referred to him as a silly brother and encouraged Fudele to join him in listening to music. A lady had continued to sing and play the banduria. She had kept singing as she reflected on how she had previously believed the ring tribe to be full of demonic beings, but up close, she had the impression that these ring people were simply normal people, or at least that this Kaime had not been terrifying and had a nice smile. When Kaime had asked Fudele if he had understood the lyrics while sitting next to him, Fudele had said that he had not and that he had not thought it had sounded good either. The lady had kept singing, and Kaime had laughed and told him that when he had been a bit older, he would think it had sounded good. He had then been asked if the lady had been attractive, to which he had said that she had been. Kaime had said that he had gotten her for him by force and now he was gifting her to him. He had already asked for him, she had still been a virgin. Fudele had hesitantly replied that he had already had Wu Lihan. After calling him by name, Kaime had given him a strong shove, causing Fudele to fly off the ground and crash on top of the lady playing for them. Fudele had looked back toward his brother and glared angrily at him. Kaime had risen up and told him that he hadn't murdered anyone or spilled a drop of blood throughout the battle, and he had questioned whether he had been worthy to be his brother. He had continued to say that a man who had not dared to shed blood had not been a warrior of his Northern Ring tribe. Either he took her or killed her, which Fudele had been furious and afraid about. Kaime had tossed a sword in his direction and threatened to murder him if he hadn't. He had pushed him to become a real man right there. Fudele was silent as Kaime laughed. Fudele contemplated either killing or stealing from her. Fudele took up his sword while the woman begged him not to kill her as she could do anything he wanted. He eventually let her go and dropped his sword, which shocked the lady. She asked whether he would be willing to let her leave, and when Fudele replied that he was, he instructed her to go through the back door and head south. She could reach her country if she continued traveling south, and nobody could harm her there because it was unsafe here. The lady replied that this place was swarming with his people and that there was no way for a helpless woman like her to escape them, which he then inquired what they should do. She asked if she would be protected by him. He blushed and promised to try the best he could to stop anyone from hurting her. Meanwhile, at the toad village, where Xiao Yu raised his hand, Cheng Dalei asked him why he wanted to fight and if he had something in mind. Xiao Yu replied that for the good of the country, and the people, his death meant nothing if he could save lives. He continued that the Ring tribe was raging everywhere, and they could only sacrifice their lives for justice, adding that he did not fear death. Bandits near Xiao Yu were muttering and laughing sarcastically while criticizing his national justice, and calling him an inexperienced boy. Cheng Dale sighed as he observed Xiao Yu's look, wondering whether Xiao Yu was the only one who wanted to fight in war. While it was simple to declare support for the country and its people, mountain bandits like him could not afford it. He kept thinking that even if he gave the people missiles, they could not win this battle since the people's hearts were not prepared for war. The only way out at the moment seemed to be escape, but Cheng Dale genuinely did not want to run away. When he questioned everyone if they still thought of him as their village leader, Gao Fei who responded that they were all at his disposal to do anything he wanted. Cheng Dale stood up, explaining that he was putting their lives in his hands by calling him the village master, but he did not have the authority to send everyone to their death. However, if he could borrow soldiers and had enough confidence to win this battle, he asked if everyone could go into battle with him. Gao Fei who asked who would be willing to help them and from whom they could borrow troops in times like that. In response, Cheng Dale said that he had made arrangements for the matter and that an update would be available over the next two days. A few days later, it rained at the foot of Kin Niu Mountain, and an army of Yuzhu soldiers walked home led by Yang Longting on horseback. Yang Longting was startled when someone shouted to block their way. It turned out to be the Toad Bandits. Yang Longting questioned Cheng Dale about what he had been doing, to which he replied that he had been waiting for him the entire time. Yang Longting asked Cheng Dale why he had been waiting for him. Cheng Dale replied that the Black Rock City had been occupied and Kin Niu Mountain was the last gate of the Empire. If the mountain were taken over by the Ring tribe, the Empire would be defenseless in the north. The Toad village of Kin Niu Mountain intended to be the front line of this battle, so Cheng Dale added that he hoped the Lord would set aside his old grudges and work with him in keeping peace. Yang Longting inquired hesitantly and perplexedly if Cheng Dale was still sick. Someone wondered what was wrong with the mountain bandit. A Yuzhu soldier questioned how a group of bandits stopped them, given that the rings invaded, while Kai Delong believed Cheng Dale was sick and dizzy from the fever. Cheng Dale said that they heard of their past 30 years ago, when the rings come to invade them. It was Yang Longting who made vigorous efforts to turn the tide. He questioned what the difference was between now and why he couldn't do today what he'd done 30 years ago. 
Yang Longting irritably questioned him, asking if he ever fought with the rings, whether he knew how powerful the rings were, and how he could possibly defend himself with an untrained crew of fewer than 10,000 people. He yelled that he fought them and knew how strong the cavalry of the rings was. 30 years ago, he got nothing to lose, but now he a reason to live, where Cheng Dalei stayed silent. Yang Longting commanded him to get out of his way, or else he would have ordered his soldiers to kill him. Cheng Dalei responded that he was the lord of Yuzhu, personally appointed by Emperor Ming. He was above everyone else and urged him that he should fight for his people. Yang Longting's hand reached inside his clothing while he responded that Cheng Dalei was disgusting. He threw his emerald-colored military seal and angrily responded that he was giving it up to him. He declared he was the lord of Yuzhu and if he wanted to defend, defend, as this was no longer his headache. The military seal, which was emerald in color and a dragon sculpture on its top, fell to the sopping wet ground in front of Cheng Dalei as it continued to rain. Cheng Dalei picked up the emerald-colored military seal. He raised it and showed it to everyone, the military seal of the Lord of Yuzhou. He asked if there were any honorable men willing to fight with him, kill the enemy, and succeed. His fellow bandits remained silent while Cheng Dalei continued showing the military seal of the Lord of Yuzhou and asked them to join. While Cheng Dalei was being avoided and the soldiers were looking down, Yang Longting advised his people to ignore him and urged them to go with him. However, determined, Cheng Dalei persisted in asking them to join while repeatedly displaying the military seal of the Lord of Yuzhu in an effort to recruit anyone willing to die for the nation. Yet, he was being ignored and passed by the soldiers. The rain continued pouring at Kin Nu Mountain as Cheng Dalei still continued shouting in hopes of recruiting someone. Cheng Dalei was interrupted by Gao Fei Hu and told his village master to head back and discuss the escape as well. While Cheng Dalei questioned going back, he argued that he still a plan left that he could use. He continued by instructing Gao Fei Hu to go back and construct a barrier at the village's entrance, and anybody who wished to flee was told to leave their horses, weapons, and armor behind. Cheng Dalei was adamant that not a single piece of iron would pass through his Kin Nu mountain. He gave the command to accompany him to Fallen Leaf City. Cheng Dalei on horseback passed by people trying to escape. He remarked that even if they managed to escape, they would not be able to live their lives as they wanted. The docks would be overcrowded, and even if they fled to the big cities, which city lord would take in these refugees? Cheng Dalei went on to say that they lacked clothing and food, which was just a way to starve and die without dignity. Someone uttered to their village master that they couldn't defend it. Cheng Dalei responded that as long as Fang Boshan provided him with 10,000 men, he could certainly defend himself with the location advantage. At the city lord's mansion in Fallen Leaf City, Lord Fang was reprimanding his men for what they'd done and why they needed these clothes while directing them to swiftly load his Jade Buddha onto the cart. When Cheng Dalei and his men came, city lord Fang was still lecturing his people, telling them that if they kept sobbing, he would leave them behind and rings would take care of them. Cheng Dalei and his men questioned what the city lord was doing. Lord Fang looked back and asked Cheng Dalei what brought him there and added that he didn't have any additional ships available for him if he wanted to borrow one. In response, Cheng Dalei said that he was not borrowing ships but rather soldiers and presented the Lord of Yuzhu's military seal. He hoisted the military seal and instructed City Lord Fang to cooperate with him to defend Kin Nu Mountain on behalf of the Lord of Yuzhu. He said that when people saw the seal, it would be like when they saw the Lord of Yuzhu. City Lord Fang questioned what Yang Longting was doing right now and Cheng Dalei replied that he was sitting in Kin Nu Mountain and ordered him to deliver the order, adding that if they could hold Kin Nu Mountain, it would be a great achievement for him. City Lord Fang responded that his military service not been as important as his head, and told his buddy Cheng that since they got along and pretended that he not seen him, he would take that as a thank you. However, Cheng Dalei was adamant with Lord Fang that if Kin Nu Mountain could not be defended, Fallen Leaf City would be destroyed. It was inevitable that the people would also be killed, and he wouldn't be able to keep his head as the ruler of the city. Cheng Dalei urged him to fight alongside them because Toad Village now a geographic advantage, food, and people. City Lord Fang began to sweat profusely when Cheng Dalei wanted to go into battle with him against the Ring Tribe. But he told him he wanted to run for his life and pleaded not to drag him along if he wanted to die. He gave Cheng Dalei his cobalt blue military seal and the authority to command the soldiers in the city as he liked, and also told him to tell the Lord of Yuzhu that he hadn't seen him. Cheng Dalei looked at the two military seals in his hands. He raised his hand bearing the military seal of Lord Fang and asked if anyone wanted to fight with him to drive out the barbarian enemy and defend their land. However, the citizens and soldiers were silent. Gao Fei who urged his village master to head back home, 
Later that night, a candle was lit near the three military seals placed on a table. Cheng Dalei was thinking and frustrated about why they couldn't try to defend it first. Why did they flee when they heard the Ring tribe, and questioned that they didn't even have the courage to hold a sword, and no one but Lin Shei Yu supported him. Cheng Dalei kept thinking Lin Shei Yu would be a great warrior, and that death wouldn't bother him. Lin Shei Yu probably thought he knew himself that they did not really have a chance to win. But Cheng Dalei strongly believed it could be won. Cheng Dalei was calling the system. However, he sat alone and the system did not show up. Cheng Dalei thought in his mind that if the system didn't come out and give him a quest, did that mean the system also thought that his time also run out? Cheng Dalei was so lonely while the system and lottery machine floated high above, staring at the stars and moon at night. The lottery called his big sister and asked her that it was time for them to give a new quest. However, the system got irritated and ignored the lottery. The lottery went on to say that the boy was at a crossroad and she should stop fretting and guide him well. The system responded that he was no longer the little boy he used to be. It was better to let him make that kind of decision himself. But in her mind, it was because she would be embarrassed to appear before him. Someone knocked at Cheng Dalei's room. It was Su Ying who informed Cheng Dalei that the people outside were all waiting for him, to which he replied to let them wait a little longer. Su Ying sat close to Cheng Dalei, sympathized with him. She knew it not been easy for him to build this family business, but when there was smoke, there was fire. She held his hand and continued to tell him that there were Su family stores everywhere in Jiju and Qingzhou. She persuaded him to hide there for a while since the rings would not stay for long and waited until the situation was over and they could always come back. Cheng Dalei was getting up as he agreed. He smiled as he told Su Ying that he was ready to go. At the Toad Village military area where a large number of bandits gathered, someone yelled to inform everyone that their village master arrived. Cheng Dalei stood in front of them and addressed them as his friends, went on to say that their wives and children were all here, and this village was built by everyone together. Cheng Dalei inquired whether they were willing to give up the village in order to be the same poor and hungry bandits they once were. They the advantage of location, the village unlimited weapons and supplies. He asked them if anyone was willing to fight alongside him and defend their village. He continued that he would not stop those who wanted to go, and those who were ready to fight should take a step forward. Lin Shei Yu firmly stepped forward in support of his village master. Worried, Cheng Dalei asked again if there was anyone else. Zhu Shenji said, never mind and forget it. As Zhu Shenji stepped forward, he questioned his daughter as to why she was following him, to which Zhu Ling'er replied and berated him for leaving her alone. Zhu Shenji responded that he lived long enough as an old man, and that today he would accompany Cheng Dalei to death, but he couldn't let his daughter follow him. He told his village master to let her go. Kin Man said that he didn't care as he believed they would all die one day. Liu Bei sighed and scratched his head. He added that the four brothers were ready to die for the village master. Little Wolf of Apricot Blossom chimed in while stepping in and told Cheng Dalei that he was hopeless, while the female bandits were worried. The second master of Flying Tiger also stated that he would follow Cheng Dalei to death, while Gao Fei who was shocked. Su Ying, Xiao Yi, and Liu Jai stepped out as well in support of their village master. Cheng Dalei thought in his mind that in the end, there were only more than 10 people. People different opinions, but with the few people there, Toad Village could not be defended. He conceded and responded that he did not have the power to make them die alongside him, and he suggested talking about the escape. However, even if they wanted to escape, they needed to listen to him. Cheng Dalei went on to say that if 5,000 people scattered like birds or wild animals, they could only become spirits through the swords of others. He told his people that if they wanted to escape, they would escape together. Cheng Dalei would not leave anyone behind. He would not give up an old person, and he would not lose a single child. Lin Shei Yu responded as his village master wished and said that he would be at his service. Cheng Dalei commanded Xiao Yu to climb Bull's Horn Peak alone, carry dry food for a month, and use the big tree as a signal to show the attack direction of the Ring tribe. He called Liao Jia and Liao Yi to come to his service. He commanded the two brothers, and they would take 1,000 men each. They would dig a canal, destroy the road, block the road with stones and trees, and buy time for everyone to retreat while the two brothers respectfully wrapped their hands into fists. Gao Fei who respectfully asked his village master if they should act overnight, as this matter was urgent and should not be postponed. Cheng Dalei responded that there was no need to hurry. The Ring tribe was still burning and looting Black Rock City, and this would last for at least another 10 days. They were scared and disorganized in the beginning, 
If they ran into every possible path without paying attention to which one they chose later, that wouldn't bring destruction upon themselves. The bandits were talking about fleeing to Bingju or Jiju, and someone said that because Bingju bordered the Ring tribe, they could end up worse if they escaped there. Cheng Dalei raised his hand and responded that Su Ying business in Jiju, and if all 5,000 of them went there, it would probably take them longer than a month. Everyone should take enough food to provide for themselves for a month. Weapons were also needed for self-defense. They should prepare everything together and cut down large trees for building horse carriages. The bandits raised their hands as well and responded to everything at their village master's command. Fast forward to the Black Rock City's city lord's mansion. Fu Delay was walking slowly while holding a hamper. He kept going away while passing discreetly behind guards. Until he arrived outside the yard of the Black Rock City, he opened a small door leading to the basement. He walked down the steps, holding a candle light in one hand and a hamper in the other. The lady asked who it was. Fu Delay responded not to be afraid because it was him. He smiled and told her to eat up because he brought it for her. They sat across from one another, with the meal and candle light placed between them. Fu Delay warned her not to choke and brought her water to drink, explaining that he couldn't always come over to her, and that this was her food supply for three days, so she needed to eat slowly. As she observed the bruising on Fu Delay's face, the lady thanked him for hiding her there and asked if he was beaten. Fu Delay responded that it was nothing, and that his brother used to beat him up a lot, so he was used to it. The lady continued to eat as she replied that she was the one who got him into trouble and thanked him before asking when they were leaving. Fu Delay replied that he did not know and they couldn't leave for now. His brother said he was looking for something here, and he did not know what it was. He thought in his mind that her expression when eating reminded him of the puppy he once had. It was also such a glutton back then and was later killed and turned into meat by his brother. The lady continued chewing while saying that Fu Delay was a good person and was different from them. If only they not come to fight with them and questioned why they were so evil and come to rob them, which made Fu Delay stunned. Silence came between them. Fu Delay remained silent while the lady noticed the awkward silence while holding her bread. The worried lady was sorry that she misspoke and told him not to pay attention to what she said. Suddenly, Fu Delay assured her that it was alright and responded that they not been able to eat for a long time. The tribe was hit by a disaster last year. A large part of the pasture land was deserted. Cattle and sheep starved, and if they not robbed them, they could not have continued to exist. Fu Delay added that enough of the unhappy stuff, told her his name was Fu Delay, and asked what her name was, to which she replied that she didn't have a name, she only a stage name which was Green Cherry. Fu Delay called her Little Cherry, which left her speechless. They both laughed and smiled. The good things of the world are not bound, but like colorful clouds, they dissolve easily, like brittle glaze, and one is full of thoughts that are in the heart and not in words. The contented person would not tire of love, and people who care about each other would talk to each other. Not everything was calculated by man. Everything was determined by fate. When the candle ran out of its light, Fu Delay took his leave, told her to take care, and said he would come to see her often. After that, she developed affection for Fu Delay. He hid green cherry in the basement, like a little dog, and wanted to check on her every day to see if she'd grown. One day, Fu Delay brought her a hamper containing her meal. He happily called her his little cherry when he came to see her and asked if she was hungry because he brought her a good meal. Fu Delay's smile quickly faded, his eyes filled with fear, and he dropped his hamper when he saw his brother, whom Kai Mei sarcastically called his good brother and asked what he brought to eat because he was asleep and got hungry. Fu Delay asked his brother if he killed her. Kai Mei replied that Fu Delay a fearsome look in his eye like a hungry wolf and questioned if Fu Delay would kill him if he told him she was dead. A fight broke out between the two brothers, where Fu Delay called his brother a bastard. However, Fu Delay was on his knees after being beaten by his brother and asked if he still wanted to be a good person. He was on the ground while his brother Kai Mei stood tall in front of him with a bottle in his hand. With visible bruises on Fu Delay's body, he was splashed with alcohol, which made him scream in pain. Kai Mei furiously asked him if he wanted to be a good person and would let him be one. While Fu Delay was face down on the dripping wet ground, he ordered two men to bring the people in. Two men brought out Green Cherry so aggressively that she stumbled on the ground. Green Cherry could only scream as she landed near Fu Delay, who managed to get up from the ground. Meanwhile, Fu Delay smiled when he saw his little cherry and realized that she was not dead. Green Cherry called Fu Delay's name when she saw him. Kai Mei said again that he would give a chance to be a good person and ordered two men to bring out the seven women. Two men brought out a string of women with their hands tied. Holding a sword, Kai Mei asked Fu Delay whether he wanted to save her. 
He questioned if he would kill these seven ladies, or if he could only save one. Kai Mei thrust the sword into the ground and repeatedly stated that he could either kill her or save seven people. Confused, Fu Delay looked up as he called his big brother. Kai Mei ordered two men to strip Green Cherry naked and do it with her in front of him. Fu Delay's eyes began to tear up as he called his brother again. Kai Mei furiously screamed at him and told him to choose. He given him the opportunity, kill one or kill seven. Meanwhile, two men began tearing and pulling Green Cherry's clothes, while she struggled on the ground. Kai Mei continued to pressure Fu Delay to take the knife and kill, to kill someone to save someone. Kai Mei told him again to take the knife and kill someone, questioning how he could save people if he couldn't learn how to kill. While Fu Delay repeatedly called his brother, Green Cherry cried and struggled as two men held her neck and continued tearing and pulling her clothes, while Kai Mei berated Fu Delay, telling him not to call him brother as he did not have a brother like him. Kai Mei called him a stupid coward and questioned if his mouth was only for pleading. He questioned Fu Delay if his knees were only for kneeling and his hand couldn't even hold a sword while Green Cherry continued crying. Kai Mei went on to say he could save one or save seven, or everyone would die, and Fu Delay was sobbing. Green Cherry cried as she pleaded to be saved repeatedly. Suddenly, Fu Delay screamed stop while his eyes welled up in rage. He snatched the blade, slashed towards Two Man, and swiped at his hand. Two Man's hands splattered blood all over, and he abruptly threw Green Cherry to Fu Delay while cursing him. They crushed onto the ground as dust and smoke billowed up around them, and they coughed it up. Kai Mei was pleased that his brother was now back on his feet. He persisted in putting pressure on him by asking if he intended to kill one or seven people, sinisterly imploring Fu Delay to tell him which one. Finally, Fu Delay stated that he didn't have to choose, which perplexed Kai Mei. Fu Delay gripped his blade tightly and went on to add that all he needed to do was kill him as he pointed his sword at him, his eyes filled with fury. Kai Mei sinisterly laughed as he watched his brother's rage boiling inside him and told him to come and kill him now. Enraged, Fu Delay advanced towards his brother who a whip in his hand and yelled at his brother to die. Kai Mei smiled as he awaited the assaults of his furious brother. After Fu Delay missed with his sword attempt, Kai Mei quickly whipped a left cut. Fu Delay looked stunned as he continued to thrash him out and told him he was moving too slowly. Fu Delay aimed for a right cut but failed to slash his brother with his sword and still continued to miss. However, Kai Mei continued whipping him out, told him to move up, and teased him to move faster and faster while he was still hitting Fu Delay. Blood began to drip, and Kai Mei told him that his steps were disorganized and he needed to calm down. Persistent, Fu Delay aimed for a middle stab but missed, and Kai Mei told him to hold onto his knife, questioning how he could kill him if he couldn't hold onto a knife while Green Cherry watched them from a distance. Green Cherry was worried as she held onto the remaining fabric of her clothing. Kai Mei whipped Fu Delay on his face and told him that he was too slow. Kai Mei aggressively fought with Fu Delay, and his little brother could only step back as he did so, berating him for being rubbish and wanting to kill him with such weak power. The whip suddenly got a hold of Fu Delay's sword. Kai Mei drew Fu Delay near to him and told him he liked the way he looked at him while teasing to kill him. Fu Delay screamed in rage. Suddenly, Fu Delay was able to cut Kai Mei's body and blood splashed, which stunned him. Kai Mei took a moment to realize what happened as he stepped back, and blood still splashed with the whip in his hand. His fingers touched the blood that dripped on his chest and tasted it. Kai Mei praised his brother, saying that finally he was willing to grow up. He pronounced that she was his and that he managed to save her. Fu Delay was breathing heavily, visible eye bruises and blood all over him. Kai Mei added that since he chosen to save her, he called for Chuo Man and ordered him to get rid of them. After licking his blade, Chuo Man started killing women. Fu Delay witnessed them being killed and was terrified. Kai Mei told his brother that it was not easy to survive in this world. He was too weak, and if only he were stronger, he could have saved everyone because it is not easy to be evil in this world. It was even more difficult to be a good person, so he grew up quickly as the weak could not protect anyone. Life was never gentle or pleasant, and it was full of blood and pain. The weak were the ones who were trampled on by the strong. Human life was just so worthless. Now that she was his, he hoped he would become a real man with her body. Kai Mei walked away as he told him to remember that it was now his possession and not to let anyone take her away from him. Neither his brother nor his father. Do not hesitate to draw his sword if someone reached for her. Meanwhile, Green Cherry sobbed while he held on to the little clothing she left. Fu Delay looked at her and called her Little Cherry. Fu Delay told her not to cry anymore, however, she was still sobbing inconsolably. He screamed at her to stop crying. Green Cherry stopped crying and gazed at him confusedly. He placed his hand on her shoulders and told her that she was his woman, and he was Fu Delay. 
He was her master and hugged her. He told her to remember his name. He would protect her from that day onwards. With Fu Delay, no one could steal her, and no one could hurt her. Life was like a divergent path between north and south. The world was long and windy, and no destiny existed with certainty. Chuo Man, eliminate the slaves who could not be transported. Kill those who to be killed and bury those who to be buried. Kaime ordered Chuo Man to call off the wolf cubs as they probably enough fun. It was time to get down to business. In the morning, the village master was questioned when they left because they was preparing for a long time already. Cheng Dale replied that it was almost time to go and he a plan in mind. It was Gao Fei who, who asked again how much more they needed to wait. If the Ring tribe came and attacked them, none of them could leave, while Cheng Dale was wondering how they could be so fast and asked him if the Ring tribe was light on their feet. Gao Fei who asked what his village master was thinking. Cheng Dale replied that he actually been thinking about one thing the whole time. He added that the Rings already raided Black Rock City and wondered why they would want to come here and attack further. Wouldn't it be embarrassing if they didn't attack and we abandoned such a great family business and ran away? Which made Gao Fei who confused and questioned what his village master meant. Cheng Dale answered that he wanted to check out Black Rock City, which surprised Gao Fei Hu and led him to tell his village master that he was out of his mind. Cheng Dale brushed it off and questioned what was crazy about it. He thought everything out carefully. He would pick a dozen of his people who could fight, go at night, and come back at night. He clarified that they wouldn't fight them, which appalled Gao Fei Hu and led him to tell his village master he was going to die. Cheng Dale told him to be silent and reminded him that he was still the head of the village and his words still counted. Gao Fei Hu tried to reason out, but he was interrupted by Cheng Dale, and told again that he was the village master and he to listen to what he said. Cheng Dale added that that night he decided he would execute this plan, which left Gao Fei Hu speechless. At dusk, Cheng Dale assembled a force of 36 people with a minimum strength of excellent rank. Lin Xiaoyu approached his village master and asked if he called him back to come along with him. Cheng Dale replied that he not, however, he another task and he needed to take a hundred. All the men sharpened their weapons, brought their bows and arrows, and set out at night. Cheng Dale led them on horseback. Cheng Dale and his team arrived near the ring's camp, which was right in front of them. He was told they couldn't go any further because they could be easily spotted by the guards outside. Cheng Dale questioned what information they could find from this distance. He suggested tying up the horses and taking a closer look. However, Gao Fei who responded to his village master that it was not a very smart idea. Cheng Dale reminded him that he was the village master and he needed to listen to him, which Gao Fei who conceded and that he was fine with it. The ring's guards were talking about them leaving and it was time for them to go to the next place because they were tired of staying here. Someone added that the women in the kingdom were born beautiful and white as lambs, while another one berated him for he dared to say such a thing and asked if he was not afraid one's wife in his house would eat him. The ring's guard continued chatting about the woman they caught and tried to negotiate to trade two cows with it, while Cheng Dale and his team lurked in the bushes. Gao Fei who got scared and asked his village master if he heard that because they were coming to kill them. He went on to say that they needed to go back to the village and prepare to escape. Suddenly, Cheng Dale ran towards the rings with his axe and yelled at the bandits of the northern rings, for the great Cheng was there, come fast and die on his axe. This shocked and scared his team while their jaws dropped because of their village master. The ring guards were alerted and questioned who it was and demanded to show himself while Cheng Dale sprinted swiftly and yelled at the scum of the rings to prepare to die. They pointed their spears for the enemy attack. However, the ring's guards' heads were chopped off, knocking out their teeth and slashing through their bodies. Tin Man told his team not to stand there and go help their village master. Shortly after that, they sprinted with their weapons in hand, and some yelled to kill them all. The ring guard yelled for enemy attack and ordered a signal to the camp. Suddenly, a firework appeared in the night sky while the ring guards were killed, and a buzzing sound was heard, which scared the toad bandits. The ring tribes quickly swarmed outside their camp and repeatedly yelled for an enemy attack. They rode their horses and carried their weapons. Cheng Dale screamed and told everyone that the wind was tight and tearing, which means that the momentum was not right and immediately withdrew. The bandits rode their horses away from the ring tribe while Gao Fei who asked what the hell he was up to. Cheng Dale responded by running for their life. If he was too slow, he would be shot by arrows of the rings. Someone notified Cheng Dale that their horses were too fast and that they almost caught them, which he assured them not to worry, leading them to the main path as he everything prepared on the main path. Cheng Dale smiled as he told them to follow him and avoided the roadblocks. Lio Jia and Lio Yi erected roadblocks, rocks, large logs, and dug deep and shallow river ditches on the official road. 
The rings were blocked by large logs where they suddenly stopped chasing them. His fellow ring member told Chuo Man that he didn't have a good feeling with so many obstacles in the way, to which Chuo Man replied that they were just a few mountain bandits. Since they killed their brother, they couldn't just let them escape. Gao Fei who looked back and told his village master that they did not seem to be able to catch up with them. He suggested they escape while they still could and hurried back to the village. However, Cheng Dale fiercely shouted and told the rings that he was the lord of the Fallen Leaf City, the ranger general of the Kin New Mountain Trap Battalion, and the holder of the Lord Seal of Yuzhu. He also called them dog bandits of the Northern Rings, coming fast and dying on his axe. This made their jaws drop in shock toad bandits and questioned what Cheng Dale was doing. Gao Fei who scolded him that they would have given up chasing them but he roared back. Cheng Dale laughed while his fellow bandit questioned him if he wanted the whole village to go down with him. They headed back to the village as the rings were coming to attack them. It was still dark, and they arrived at the village and quickly opened the gate, repeatedly. The gate opened and they went inside swiftly, while the bandits on the top of the gate wondered what was behind them when the village master was back. They were stunned for a short while and suddenly realized it was the rings. A bandit screamed that the rings were attacking them, while someone shouted that the rings were attacking them. The bandit complained about how they could escape, that they were finished, they felt totally awful, and turned to their village master who was eager to seek death when they should have run for their lives, while Cheng Dale remained silent. Gao Fei who confronted Cheng Dale that he wouldn't escape, he wasted time and brought the ring there purposely to drag them to death with him. Su Ying thought of Cheng Dale as she watched and stood on the side. Suddenly, Cheng Dale smiled and laughed loudly. He answered them that they were right, he never wanted to escape. Cheng Dale went on to say that fleeing, fleeing to where, like a dog turning its back on the enemy, and questioning whether they could really escape. He took his sword and pointed at the rings, and shamed his people for being afraid before they even fought. Now that the rings arrived, this place already become a desperate situation. There was no way back, and he no choice but to lay down their lives and fight. The bandits kept saying that their escape was no longer possible but depending on it was. Someone questioned that their opponents were the rings, and only 2,000 people of them could fight. They asked if they could defend against them. Cheng Dale confidently replied that there were only a few thousand pursuers and what was there to be afraid of. Cheng Dale reminded Gao Fei Hu that he didn't say the rings were invincible, and today he would kill them to show him. A thousand ring members on horseback rode and aimed to attack. Cheng Dale called for blacksmith Zhu and ordered her heavy crossbowmen to push up the heavy crossbows, to which she agreed immediately. As the rings approached near the toad village, Cheng Dale commanded teams of five, all on his signal. He told them not to be nervous and to behave as they would in normal training. The shield bearers went right for cover, adjusted the angle, and let them come closer. The horses moved quickly while Chuo Man alerted his people that they some people up there ready for firing arrows, and that the trap battalion would break down the door with him and kill them all. The ring's men shot their arrows simultaneously, aimed at the top gate while they came near the gate. Cheng Dale commanded the shield troops to the front. As a result, they were able to block the arrows successfully. He directed them to aim the lights of the fire below and spread the heavy crossbows. Cheng Dale called for Team 1 to get ready and released. In the darkness, it was completely impossible to see the real shape of the village from a few hundred meters away. When they arrived at the gates, they saw the high wall, which was difficult to overcome. Chuo Man thought in his head it was a trap, and there were still crossbow arrows that cut through the night sky. Chuo Man was hit right into his chest and screamed with fear in his eyes. A lot of the ring members were hit, blood began to splash, and they lost their balance and fell from their horses. Cheng Dale commanded his team to load the crossbow and called the stone throwing team 2 to get ready. Cheng Dale shouted for release, where a stone, several stones, flew with the rings and heavy bang was heard as soon as it reached unto them. Some were able to dodge, however, some didn't. The rings repeatedly yelled to pull back because it was a trap, repeatedly. Another one yelled to hold formation and return to camp for support. The hastily retreating cavalry joined the charging cavalry like a great wave. People rolled back and forth, and there was no telling how many people and horses perished from the trampling in the darkness. The rings repeatedly alerted his fellow troops to retreat. They fell back quickly while heavy and large stones flew and still aimed at them. Gao Fei who was shocked when he saw the rings were knocked back by this. Cheng Dale responded where he said every day that the rings were invincible, that they were strong and the courage of a million men. Everyone the same opinions, that was why the rings could break Yuzhu in a day, and the Black Rock City in half a day, and berated them. They were bound by fear even before the battle started. Cheng Dale furiously told them now that he shown them. 
The rings were not three-headed, they know six arms and were invulnerable to swords and spears, they were not monsters, they were also born from the parents, and raised by mother and father, and they were just as human as them. They screamed when they were in pain, they were afraid to die, and they could be defeated when they were overwhelmed by enemies, and now the heavy crossbow team continued until they were out of range or they ran out of arrows. The bandits' courage and morale were lifted, as they were eager to fight and get in line. While Cheng Dale gazed at the fleeing men of the Ring tribes, his fellow bandits argued about who was shooting arrows. Cheng Dale stood at the top of their stone walls, ordered his people that they were out of range and did not waste crossbow arrows. He said that there were only remnants of wounded soldiers below, and he called for the good men of Toadstool to get ready with him as they would rush out and kill those animals quickly. Cheng Dale raised his swords while his people cheered for him. Their gate was opened and they rushed out on their horseback for an attack. 2,000 men from the mountain fortress rushed out to kill the fleeing rings, while the remnants of the rings tribe were only two or three hundred people, and the men and horses were exhausted. Besides, they injuries, they simply could not offer effective resistance. Cheng Dale was not in a hurry to kill them but only wanted to slowly exhaust the physical strength of the survivors. Eventually, the survivors were driven into a ravine by Cheng Dale's deliberate pursuit. This was like a bag. The hundred Liu family elites that Lin Shei led were the last rope to close this bag, and he alerted his troops that they were coming. Lin Shei said that the leopard wolf was in the bag and struck. Overnight, 720 ring members died at the city gates, and the 300 survivors were annihilated at the Kin New Mountain Pass. From the Toad Village, several people were killed, dozens were seriously wounded, and more than a hundred were lightly wounded. Warning came at the Kin New Mountain. Somewhere at the white tents of the Ring tribe camp, someone thought in his head that there were only a dozen people who should have been killed by now, but kept wondering why there was no news even after sunrise. These people from the kingdom were easy to kill. Could it be that they come across a village in the mountains and started looting again, or did Chuo Man get ambushed and they were dead? It was Kai Mei, and someone on horseback arrived at his tent to report. At sunset, the northern Ring tribe set out from their camp and sent troops to the Kin New Mountain. The battle's aftermath, including a field covered with blood and bodies, was a disaster in front of the Toad Village. The Toad Bandits pulled the bodies and buried them. As they draped a white cloth over their faces, they placed the dead in a carriage. While Cheng Dale stood by himself atop their gate, the sun was going to set. He didn't say anything as he stared down at the bloody bodies lying on the ground. After continuing to gaze at the bodies, Cheng Dale closed his eyes. A voice emerged and told him that he fought a beautiful battle today. Cheng Dale replied that it was not bad and that today was just the beginning. It was the system and referred to him as a young man, and it was a long time. Cheng Dale told her that she was not out for so long. If it was not for the raffle machine, he would have thought she disappeared while the system teased him if he missed her. It was a year since Cheng Dale entered this world, and he always wanted to ask her this question. He told the system. Because of her existence, he couldn't help but think that this world was actually just a game. The information of the people on Kin New Mountain. He could read it whenever he wanted, just like a game and PC. Their character biographies, skills, and even some personal data could appear, but later, he found that there were many people whose data he couldn't check. Like Lai Xingya, the fortune teller old man, even Hull. He could only see that he was a member of the Ring tribe. Cheng Dale went on to say that the system's ability to view NPCs was not powerful, and some people deliberately disguised themselves because he could not see through them. As he learned more about this world, his image and the system's presence were incompatible with this world. The world is real, the system was more like a fusion of Cheng Dale's memories, a poor imitation of the system in his mind than the system's stream novel. Although the system very little authority in the world they were in, trembling with fear using cheats and exploiting a bug, the rewards granted would also not exceed the limits of the era either. Since he came to this world, he wanted to live and understand things clearly. Cheng Dale questioned the system whether she was a ghost, god, or demon, if she chosen him, but what she wanted him to do. The system responded that her real name was Heart, and her birth seemed to be related to his soul. She explained that when she first woken up as a system elf, she was just stupid and ignorant. She only known that as soon as she was born, she was given the permission to manage the system. With that, she could give a mission, operate a raffle machine, and even improve the system's functions, offering unlimited possibilities. The system added that it was a divine thing with strange abilities, enough to change the world. Even though she hadn't actually known what it was, it left Cheng Dale confused. The system added that Cheng Dale carried memories of things that this world did not currently have, and she was born because of it. She guided him along the way. 
The system winked at Cheng Dale and said that perhaps they wouldn't know the answer until they got to the end of the road. Cheng Dale was disappointed that the system was acting like a Riddler again and asked for more useful information. The system sighed as she replied that she could only answer a limited number of questions because she didn't know much about these things. Perhaps the raffle machine knew more than she did. Cheng Dale said that maybe when he was transported, both of them was merged by accident. At that time, a beauty caught his sight and he wanted to make her his own. When he seen treasure, he wanted to steal it. He continued to say that when facing a thousand soldiers of Black Rock City, he hadn't hesitated to kill, becoming greedy and cold-blooded. Some part of his real personality was disappearing slowly, and even to the point that he needed to release Liu Heng, who slaughtered a village, when he was a guy who'd just been transported, when he gained the awareness to kill a person. Furthermore this abnormal possessiveness. He lived a good life and questioned why he was transported and why the system shouldn't have been hers. The system sighed and placed her hand near Cheng Dale's face. Suddenly, the system flicked her finger on his forehead and called Cheng Dale an idiot. The system explained that he was fusing with his dumbass and that was his newbie protection period. She added that he'd just been a newbie who not experienced life and death. She only thrown him directly into the battlefield to gain experience. She was afraid that it would only take a few more days before he went mad. The system added that when Cheng Dale just arrived in this world, the system amplified his desire so that he got the motivation to adjust in this world. She temporarily protected him from the fear of death so that he was not afraid in front of the enemy. He was able to hold his weapon steadily, and he was not soft-hearted towards the enemy until he adapted to this world. The system furiously stated that she given him a strong heart, yet he was not satisfied. She complained that the hosts were really getting worse and worse at serving. She told him that he was transported because he stayed up late and died due to lack of sleep. Do not become a victim of delusional disorder every day. Cheng Dale was stunned and unable to speak. He realized that he stayed up late and died suddenly, while the system called him stupid and asked if he had any other questions. Cheng Dale sighed as he replied that he had one more question. He asked how long the newbie protection lasted, to which the system responded that it didn't last long. After a thousand Black Rock City soldiers began to disappear, the system questioned why he asked. Cheng Dale answered both Su Ying and Liu Zheng. He knew their feelings for him, but when he came to this world, he always felt detached from it. He always thought he liked Su Ying because of the system's influence on him, and he did not know whether that feeling in his heart was real or not. He always felt that just because he wanted to complete the task, the system sent him to pursue Su Ying, and he felt like he lost some value. The system replied that the newbie protection was long gone and asked himself whether it was true that he feelings for her, while Cheng Dale said that he should take into consideration that they were both sociable. The system suggested he go chase her. This time there was no pressure from the mistress of the fort mission. He should go and propose to her. However, Cheng Dale hesitated because the ring tribe could invade anytime. The system replied to hurry up. If he was late, he wouldn't have a chance while Cheng Dale could only agree. Meanwhile, the system labeled him as a retarded guy. Later that night at the Toad Village, someone knocked on a door. It was Cheng Dale, and Xiao Yi opened the door when he asked if Miss Ying was asleep. Xiao Yi replied that she was about to rest. Xiao Yi invited him to come in. Su Ying was sitting on her bed and asked Cheng Dale why he was still there at such a late hour, worried that something happened. Cheng Dale was biting his lip and responded that he would like to talk to her about something. He told Xiao Yi to go out for a moment and referred to her as a little butterfly. However, Xiao Yi questioned his village master and asked what he wanted to do. Suddenly, little Xiao Yi was carefully thrown out by Cheng Dale. She looked back and was annoyed. She peered near the closed window in hopes of listening to what he to say. The candle was lit in the room, where Su Ying asked how long it would be before the ring would attack them. Cheng Dale replied in about two or three days because the marching speed of the rings was fast. Su Ying asked what he wanted to talk about. Cheng Dale blushed when he slowly asked if she wanted to marry him now. Su Ying's face turned red and she questioned the timing. Cheng Dale replied that he knew this was very abrupt, and he didn't have a gift or a ceremony, or anything. But if she waited until after the war and he proposed to her, it would feel strange, like he was planting a flag. So, Cheng Dale asked her again if it was better to be early rather than later, and if she would marry him. Su Ying was silent, and Cheng Dale kept saying that if she did not want to, he suggested they could slowly develop feelings for each other. She replied for him to relax a little and asked him if he was too nervous for his own good. Cheng Dale was speechless as he looked away. He replied not to take his words seriously, slowly turned around, and said that she should rest early. He was near the door and added that after this battle, they did not even know whether they would live or die. Su Ying called Cheng Dale, 
which stopped him from leaving the room. She stood up, responding that she thought she was already his while her face was blushing. They kissed in the candlelit room. When she lost her virginity, he fell in love with her. She sensed that the gentleman was not blushing and turned to him with a hug. Suddenly, the light went out. This made Zio you wonder as she continued to peek into the room. Their act of love burst out little red hearts in the air. When Zio Yi heard what was happening, Cheng Dale and Su Ying continued making love, which resulted in more little red hearts bursting in the room. Zio Yi was startled when she suddenly realized they were making love. She walked away. It was too sudden and she was worried about Su Ying because she was an absolute blockhead when it came to this. She should have asked his mother to show her those positioned pictures first. And Zio Yi was not sure if there were any herbs in the village that strengthened the body. The system was sitting on the roof, gazing at the stars and moon, and uttered that it was hard for her to say anything while she was enjoying a few moments of wind and rain. She was surprised and smiled when she received a notification ding that they were rewarded with half a day of rain and wind. Meanwhile, at the Black Rock City, someone was announcing that anyone who did not arrive within 10 drum beats would be executed. They were in formation while their division was being called group by group, signifying their presence. Someone called the attention of all northern ringers. It was Kai Mei leading them and commanding them to go as he led the way. They started their journey in the Kin New Mountain. While they marched on the roads of the mountain, Lin Sheyu, covered in a makeshift grass suit, was observing them from the top of a mountain edge. He continued to observe them and estimated about 10,000 men, heavy cavalry, light cavalry, foot soldiers, prisoners, provisions, and their path. Shortly after that, he hurriedly headed out because he needed to notify his village master. Lin Sheyu stood alongside a tree on Bullhorn Mountain, still wearing his grass suit. The tree began to make a harsh rasping sound. Lin Sheyu was shaking the tree, sending a signal to the toad village. The second master noticed that the tree on top of Bullhorn Peak was moving, which meant Lin Sheyu was giving the signal. The second master, reading the signals, told his fellow bandits to notify the village master because the rings were coming from the north. The morning came at Kin New Mountain. A few thousand northern rings marched. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale and his troops lurked in the distant bushes. He said that their speed slowed down a lot. However, Gao Fei who added that those ravines and wooden barriers wouldn't hold them for long. Cheng Dale responded that they would escape once they shot some arrows. They wouldn't be able to chase them once they got deep into the mountains. He raised his hand and called his troops' attention to ready their bows and arrows. Cheng Dale fiercely screamed for a release. Some of the members of the ring tribe and horses were hit and lost their balance. Kai Mei furiously alerted his people that there was an ambush and to watch out for hidden archers. He commanded the longsword group to go after and kill them. Cheng Dale, leading his troops, ran deep into the mountain and told them to keep up with him. All of his troops followed their village master into the mountains. The mountain became silent. A ring member reported to the prince that they couldn't find them after they vanished into the woods, and the forest was too dense. This shocked Kai Mei that they lost them. Kai Mei ordered the scout to explore the road ahead and reminded them to pay attention to the surroundings. With the geographical advantage, Cheng Dale kept setting traps on the road, and the enemy was greatly slowed down. Finally, at dusk three days later, the Ring army arrived outside the Toad village. Kai Mei was holding a map and thought in his mind that he finally found it. The river crossed between both Bullhorn Peaks, and behind the peaks lay what he was looking for. Kai Mei wondered how it could become a city when it was a densely wooded valley. He kept wondering whose army was stationed here, and if it was possible that they were the ones who attacked them a few days ago. He brushed it off, just broke down the gate, slaughtered the whole city, and they would have what was buried there. Kai Mei called for all his troops and they obeyed his order. He shouted to kill and attack the city. The rings ran towards the city with their weapons, barriers, and ladders. Cheng Dale was informed that they were coming so fast, they did not even have to rest and set up a camp. He commanded his people to get ready because it was an all-out war. The ring's troops were organized and prepared to go up in one go. The battle began, and the rings were climbing on their ladders while arrows and stones flew everywhere. The bandits were steadfast in holding their positions and getting them down. However, they were shocked when the ring's tribe began throwing large stones. The bandits were alerted to watch out. However, a flaming blast struck once along with the rocks, and as a result, some of them flew back. Kin Man called Zhang Fei to come with him to block the defense line that was broken. The ring managed to climb up and kill while the frontline bandits were struggling and calling for support. Xilong was called out to stop them. Xilong responded that he understood while his brother laughed. The ring members who managed to climb realized that it was a dead end but got slain on the spot. They successfully blocked the rings and confidently told them to not even think about coming up. 
Little Wolf was slaying and slashing rings with his sword. A massive wooden pointy log was seen with the rings as they continued to charge. The attack came like an ocean wave as the rings tried to break the city gate. One wave went down with a loud bang. The bandits poured oil when the one came up again. They ignited with fire. As a result, the ring members on the ladder were burning alive. They continued banging the city wall like waves splashed, while some ring members complained it was so hot. The first attack made by the ring tribe began at dusk. At 3 o'clock, the ring troops retreated. When the attack failed, Kaime took advantage of the night to set up camp three miles away from the Toad Village. Kingju and Yizhu were located on the map after Kin New Mountain. Chani city of Kingju docks was peaceful and calm. However, at the city lord's mansion, someone admitted their difficulties but still invited their buddy to come and join them despite having a large family and keeping everyone safe. Inside a room, they kept talking and told Lord Fang that they liked the pearls and jades. Lord Fang told the woman he referred to as Madam that she was too kind. He told her to take anything she wanted, while the lady smiled yet felt embarrassed receiving such luxurious gifts. Lord Fang watched her walk away and told her to take care. He sighed. He was in tears as many people asked him for money and treasure, but that was the only way to live under the roof of another, to live by his grace and read his mood. Lord Fang sobbed and wondered how long his family's wealth was going to last. A soldier came in and repeatedly called his city lord's attention. He was scolded by Lord Fang and told to lower his voice because the wall's ears. He reminded him not to call him that there and let others think they were into role-playing. Lord Fang asked how the matter he inquired about gone. His soldier reported to Lord Fang that the Ring tribe hadn't killed Cheng Dale yet when he asked the people who come from Yuzhu before they left. Lord Fang wondered if they hadn't killed him yet and questioned if the rings ran away after robbing the Black Rock City, to which the soldier responded if he thought Cheng Dale could stop the Ring tribe. Lord Fang replied that it was not possible. The northern barbarians over 10,000 armored horses. He ordered to double-check it and find out what was going on at Bullhorn Mountain, to which the soldier agreed. Meanwhile, at Yuzhu City, soldiers protecting the gates were positioned in a line, each with a spear in their hand. Yang Longting was ordering Kai DeLong to prepare more large crossbows. If they wanted to defend the city, bows and arrows were essential. Kai DeLong responded that he asked the craftsmen in the city to work overnight to make 100,000 arrows in one month. Yang Longting furiously questioned the time and sarcastically told them to hurry up because the northern barbarians would not give him a month, and they could not lose this battle. Kai DeLong responded with his fist clenched, and they made haste. Yang Longting observed his soldiers in formation who stood with their spears in hand. He asked the young man his age, to which the young man replied, Your Majesty, I am 16. Yang Longting praised him for being a good man and asked if he was afraid. The young man replied that he wasn't. Yang Longting laughed and responded that he himself was also afraid, wondering how the young man could not be. Yang Longting added that if he was afraid, he shouldn't do it, but emphasized that they would protect their homes and defend their country. He told the young soldier that when the Great War came, he and the king would fight the enemy, to which the young soldier agreed. The soldiers addressed their majesty and asked him to take care as he left. The morale and courage of the Yuzhu soldiers were lifted because they did not expect the king of Yuzhu to talk to the young soldiers. They kept talking about the king being a good man and how he drove away the Ring tribe. Other soldiers chimed in, saying that following him was not a bad idea. A report was received inside the city lord's mansion in Yuzhu City. A soldier knelt down as he reported to his majesty that the Ring tribe hadn't crossed the Bullhorn Mountain yet. Yang Longting was skeptical about them not coming out yet as it didn't feel right. He asked about the whereabouts of the bandits of Kin New Mountain and where they escaped. The soldier responded that they hadn't seen them coming out of Kin New Mountain. Yang Longting thought to himself and wondered if Fool Cheng Dale was really trying to stop the Ring tribe. He ordered to scout once again to find out the situation on Kin New Mountain, to which the soldier agreed. Meanwhile, many people, like Yang Longting, sent scouts to infiltrate Kin New Mountain. City lords, bandits, and rich families were everywhere. Imperceptibly, countless pairs of eyes rested there. The talks of Kin New Mountain never been in the limelight like they were today. Among those fleeing from the wars, some people were thinking of rising again, while others were ready to pack their belongings and move away from the war. Just like how Su Lishi and the young man walked away together, happily. Moments later, at Toad Village, Huang Sanyuan was reporting to Cheng Dale. Since they already fought with the Ring tribe, the courage of their warriors diminished. The fighting power of their warriors simply could not compare with the Ring tribe. Huang Sanyuan added that their defense formation was relatively strong and if someone was injured, there would be a new person to replace them. In last night's battle, they were fortunate that no one died. 
but the total number of severely and mildly injured warriors was more than a hundred. Those who were wounded was sent to Liu Bei, the medicine was still sufficient, so there was nothing to worry about. Cheng Dalei inquired about the damage to the city wall. Huang Sanyuan responded that the Ring tribe was not proficient at using stone throwers. Some of the stones did not hit the city, and some flew over the city, which was currently being repaired by their warriors. Cheng Dalei asked about the weapons and how Blacksmith Zhu was doing, to which he replied that the women and children of the village sped up the production of arrows. They cut a lot of wood before, and the raw materials were also sufficient. Huang Sanyuan added that the damage to the giant crossbows was being repaired by Blacksmith Zhu and the blacksmiths of the village were making more giant crossbows and stone throwers. Cheng Dale confidently replied and smiled that the Ring tribe was just like that. As long as they were given some more time, they might be able to train them into elite soldiers who were disciplined. When the time came, they could wipe out the scum of the Ring tribe. Wang Sanyuan replied that this was just the first wave at best. It was only an appetizer before the main event and advised his village master that this shouldn't be taken lightly. However, he thought in his mind, because of his village master's confidence, could they really win this battle? A simultaneous rustling sound was heard outside their village. Cheng Dale was alerted of an enemy attack, and the Ring tribe was attacking their city again. He ordered Hu and Sanyuan to light the wolf smoke and sound the war drums. He commanded archers, giant crossbows, stone throwers, and everyone to position because a new wave of enemies was coming. A bandit pointed to his village master to look out. The Ring tribe came out in much larger numbers. Cheng Dale couldn't believe what he saw. Refugees were marching in their direction, pleading with them to help them. The terrified refugees were pleading with them to let them in so they could rescue themselves and their kids. Cheng Dale thought in his mind that they were planning to get inside the city using a wave of refugees. Huang Sanyuan stated that those savages used the refugees to charge at the city. They inquired of their village master about what they should do. The Ring tribe advanced behind the refugees. Kaimei, who was on his horse and far behind, watched the battle. Kaimei thought in his mind that they didn't have a powerful crossbow, and observed their faces and eyes as they cried out for the gates to be opened to save them. He questioned whether they would have the courage to kill both them and their own people. These refugees pleaded for help in a desperate attempt to avoid dying. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale softly taken in all of their cries at the same time. Dao Fei who asked Cheng Dale if they were already in range and if the Ring tribe was behind them. Cheng Dale responded to prepare the heavy crossbow archers, tighten the spring, he raised his hand, all of them under his command. Cheng Dale's hand was shaking. The refugees were still praying and crying to be saved. For a moment, Cheng Dale was speechless. However, the Ring's tribe was fast approaching. Cheng Dale shouted in frustration, release. Several arrows flew from the sky like rain and hit the ground and the rain of arrows continued. Many of the refugees were struck by arrows and died while lying on the ground. As a result, Cheng Dale received a series of notifications, increasing his fear points by approximately 10,000 points. The bandits were startled and frightened yet remained silent. Cheng Dale's fear points continued to rise by several thousand points as the arrows continued to rain down on the refugees and puncture right through their bodies. Cheng Dale was teary-eyed when he called out his second team to get ready while receiving a series of notifications because he was obtaining fear points. He kept racking up fear points as the majority of the refugees lay on the ground with arrows protruding from their bodies. Cheng Dale's tears streamed down his face as he shouted, release. Even a child was not spared by the arrows and was on the ground, and Cheng Dale continued obtaining fear points from the refugees. On the other hand, Kaimei thought in his mind that it was decisive. But as long as they could block the first rain of arrows and disrupt their army, their goal would be achieved. Their next step would be to attack the city. The rings raced fiercely towards the city with their weapons, barriers, and ladders. As other refugees searched for their parents, Cheng Dale kept hearing the refugees begging for help, pleading with him to save them and spare them death. He thought in his mind while crying that those dead and wounded refugees, their cries and laments were all transmitted directly to his mind. Countless emotions of fear hit his mind like a tidal wave, despair, resentment, agony, sorrow, and he wondered about the heavy stench like a mixture of blood and inert smell. Tears continued streaming down his face. He called out to the system that something was wrong and questioned why she was doing this and if this was what she wanted to make him feel. Gao Fei who notified Cheng Dale that they were coming. Teary-eyed, Cheng Dale commanded all troops to hold the city wall, not letting those animals set foot on their fortress, Otherwise, they would end up like those refugees, and behind them was where their families were. 
All the bandits fiercely screamed as they agreed with their village master. Stone and arrows went inside the toad village while the second team was told to maintain their position and go, while others screamed to kill and attack the city. Kin Man and a few other bandits slashed through the ring members climbing through the ladder. Other bandits even drew arrows at short range and swung swords in defending their city. The ring members were close to climbing to the top yet they would be slain and screamed as they fell back down. Guan Yu led the archers and told them to stand back and maintain formation, to which they agreed. While his brothers were fiercely fighting off using their flaming spears and stabbing the sky to kick those ring dogs off the wall and kill. The ring members struggled, but they held the ladder and still charged up there while others screamed as they fell from the sky. Kaime was notified that the situation was not good and it was difficult to open a gap to attack. They lost too many of their men in the attack and suggested the soldiers retreat. Kaime gestured with his hand to withdraw and retreat. Moments later, a person who didn't have parents would hold and carry a burden, fearing that he would not live a long life. Who know brothers like feet and hands, who know husband and wife like a guest or a friend. What was the blame for being born and what was for killing, yet no one knew whether he lived or died. Someone believed what people said but doubted it because she dreamed it. It was the system and she cried for the end of the world. The heaven and earth were sad, and the trees were mournful. The soul no place to go when the sacrifice did not come. There would be a bad year, and people would be displaced. The system was sitting and questioning the meaning of time and fate from ancient times. This so-called war was such a brutal thing. Cheng Dale stared at the system screen and thought of his fights in the last few days where he actually got two or three hundred thousand fear points out of the rings. He believed that the rings were not afraid of death when they fought a war and that according to yesterday's battle he actually got hundreds of thousands directly from the refugees. Cheng Dalai thought that his one million fear points could be exchanged for a top character. Staring at the screen intensely, he reasoned that the amount was won by an underhanded method. He tapped on the screen and asked the system to summon a character. As Cheng Dalai tapped, a light appeared from the screen. The system appeared and told Cheng Dalai that she had received his request. An orb of light came into view as the system chanted that the heartbeat of the world would usher in the light of the stars. The system continued her chants, stating that millions of emotions would cross the summon platform and flow directly into people strong enough to shake the world. While holding the orb of light, the system smiled. Amused, Cheng Dalei thought that the skipped scene last time would just look like that. He requested the system to pity him and let him go over his difficulties as he wished for a strong character. While closing her eyes, the system continued mumbling that the hero of the story was reborn and was about to cross time and space to come. The orb of light glowed brighter as it pulsed around the place. A man appeared. A notification stated that the legendary military general was obtained, the leopard head Lin Chong. Info of Lin Chong appeared, stating that he was a martial artist unknown to the public as his age was 33 years old. And as for his skills, he had the wave-breaking sevenfold spear while his hidden attribute was a thousand miles long search for his beloved. Unamused, Cheng Dalei asked the system if Lin Chong was coming. He looked at the screen seriously as he thought that he only had a level 3 village building without the additional attributes of a level 3 village. Cheng Dalei believed that he should be able to upgrade the village to level 3 since there were already three top martial artists. He tapped on the screen and told the system to upgrade the village. The system notified Cheng Dalei that the upgrade had failed because it had insufficient conditions, which made Cheng Dalei confused. He repetitively tapped the screen however the result was still the same. Cheng Dalei's face darkened while the system watched behind him. She told Cheng Dalei that Lin Chong hadn't yet come and that he had to wait until he entered the village to upgrade, while Cheng Dalei looked at her with disappointment. Depressed, Cheng Dalei wondered if Lin Chong was capable of such a great feat, and told the system that the rings had surrounded the village to the hilt while also wondering if he could come to the village alive after passing through the rings. While Cheng Dalei looked at the rings camp and mumbled that if Ling Chong was killed by the rings while trying to reach the village, he would lose a great general for nothing. As the afternoon sun was seen in the horizon Cheng Dalei wondered where Lin Chong's whereabouts. Meanwhile, at the northern ringers camp, a man's voice mumbled that they had been fighting for so long, yet they didn't even know what kind of force Cheng Dalei had. Another man added, wondering where all those monkeys came from. The man on the right wondered since when did the people of the empire become so stubborn as usually they collapse at the first attack. While the other man on the left chimed in that they attacked twice in a row but without success, and that many lives were lost in vain. The others added that some of the smaller tribes were completely wiped out in the battle. Hu Luxing voiced out his opinion telling them that if he had known that so many people would die, he would have left after the Battle of Black Rock City as they also did a lot of looting. 
Aggravated, the man on his side asked Hu Luxing if he was saying such things because he was afraid. Hu Luxing stood up and told Gan Linying while he was still riding a young horse, he could kill when he was nine years old. Gan Linying also stood inviting Hu Luxing to a fight if he was not convinced. Hu Luxing cursed aggressively and told Gan Lingyan how dare he speak up, while another man joined in their argument telling them that if he didn't give them two punches they wouldn't even know why flowers were so colorful. Kai Mei's face darkened as he thought that subordinates were difficult to lead when he had such stupid people under him. He reasoned if they could have read more in their spare time. He thought that there's no wonder why the Empire calls them barbarians. Kai Mei wondered how nice it would be if he lived in the flowery world of the Empire, and was not confronted with uncouth barbarians every day. Meanwhile, a drum noise was heard all around the place. Hu Luxing wondered about the noise as he believed that the enemy could be attacking. Gan Linying looked at Kai Mei wondering if they really dared to rush over as lowland warfare was their specialty. Kai Mei stood up from his seat and told his subordinates that they were going to take a look outside. They rode a horse as they looked over the toad village who was making the noise. Gan Linying warned Kai Mei for their hidden arrow and that they could not go any further. Kai Mei mumbled wondering what the toad village were trying to do. While holding a paper, Zhang Fei cleared his throat while Huang Sanyuan raised his hand and told his men that it was enough as their enemies came out and that they didn't need to drum anymore. Zhang Fei read the paper telling them that he had heard that the ringers had a strong fighting style and were famous for their horsemanship. He was ordered to read as he had the loudest voice and he could also read and write. Zhang Fei continued telling the rings that Cheng Dalei said that the martial arts of the rings were nothing more than the fighting methods of the animals, and the real martial arts would have to be taught to them by the empire, and that as of today the two armies face each other, and that Cheng Dalei couldn't bear the feudal sacrifice of the soldiers of both sides as he was ready to fight with the warriors of the rings alone on horseback. He asked Kai Mei if he could defeat Cheng Dale. They were ready to open the city gates and raise their hands and surrender. Kai Mei's face darkened. He asked them who they were as to which Zhang Fei couldn't answer. Zhang Fei looked at Cheng Dale telling him that the rings asked who they were, to which Cheng Dale couldn't believe such a question. Cheng Dale took a step towards the edge and mocked the rings telling them to listen carefully. He introduced himself as the Ranger General of the Trap Battalion in King Niu Mountain, and that he was the Lord of the Fallen Leaf City in the Empire, and also the owner of the Royal Seal of Yuzhu and the axe master whom the gods have passed their abilities to. As his face darkened he ended his statement that he was also the toad king who guards the King Niu Mountain. Cringing, the rings wondered who the hell Cheng Dale was. Zhang Fei shouted that many famous characters had died under Cheng Dale's axe, as he proceeded to ask the rings what they were. Kai Mei coughed, signaling Gan Linying to give him a good shout as they were unable to lose their own reputation, to which Gan Linying also agreed. Gan Linying yelled and introduced Kai Mei. Kai Mei was embarrassed and thought that it was scary to be uneducated while Gan Linying happily told him that it was done. Another drum noise was made as the wooden bridge slowly fell down. The toad village gate was opened, as Kin Man rode out with his horse. He introduced himself and asked the rings who would come to die under his spear. Kai Mei looked back and asked his men which one of them wanted to kill Kin Man. All the men behind were simultaneously agreed to be the one who would kill Kin Man. A horse's hooves and a man came rushing towards Kin Man. Kai Mei wondered who the man was, to which one of his subordinates informed him that the man seemed to be a martial artist who had defected to the northern barbarians and that he also possessed some skills. The man told Cheng Dale to come out of the city, wishing him to let him smash his head with his stick. Cheng Dale leaned towards the edge as he saw Du Mao and wondered. Du Mao yelled, mocking Cheng Dale to come down and have a fight with him. Cheng Dale thought how Du Mao was not dead and how he had joined the Ring tribe. He replied to Du Mao telling him that he respected him as a man asking him how he could become a tiger after joining the Ring tribe and if he wasn't afraid of his ancestors cursing him from their graves. He asked Du Mao to put down his weapons and fight the barbarians together with him. Du Mao responded by calling Cheng Dale retarded and told him to stop talking nonsense, asking for him to come down so he could let his stick knock his head. While looking at the battlefield, Cheng Dale replied that he would make Du Mao regret his decision. Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man to kill Du Mao. Kin Man charged and raised his spear and told Du Mao to accept his death as he was a traitor. Du Mao readied himself and mumbled, very good. Both of their weapons clashed. As both men fiercely wanted to kill each other, Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale if he thought that Kin Man could win. Cheng Dale told him that it was hard for him to say, as Kin Man and Du Mao's skills should have been equally matched. He added that if he wanted to win, they would have to use an unusual move. Both Du Mao and Kin Man fought ferociously. The spear of Kin Man almost hit the face of Du Mao. Kin Man's eyes grew wide as he saw Du Mao smiling and was about to counter. 
Gu Mao swung his club to which Kin Man barely managed to parry and struggle. Hu Luxing mumbled that the two were equally matched and if they were a little clumsy, their heads would fall on the battlefield. Kai Mei responded that it seemed that the Empire also had such heroes, masters who were not inferior to their tribe experts. Gan Linying chimed in that he pitied such a great martial artist. Zhu Shenji's jaw dropped as he thought that the fight did not look good. Cheng Dalei told him not to worry and just watched carefully. As both men fought, Kin Man glared at his opponent intently. The horse hooves continued to clatter. Kin Man's spear hit Du Mao's horse which led to Du Mao falling to the ground. Cheng Dalei mumbled that the winner had been decided. Kai Mei ordered one of his men to send someone to fetch Du Mao back as he was still useful. Kin Man was about to swing his spear going for Du Mao's head. He yelled at Du Mao to die. Du Mao's eyes grew wide as he grit his teeth hard. Kin Man's spear missed Du Mao who was lying to the ground. Meanwhile, another horse appeared and grabbed Du Mao's clothes, dragging him away. Enraged, Kin Man told them not to run away and rushed after both men. Cheng Dalei ordered Kin Man not to chase after the enemy, as to which Kin Man turned to look at him. He added that if he chased too deep, he would get hit by the ring's arrows. He ordered Kin Man to come back. Kin Man flat out obeyed Cheng Dalei's orders and went back to the city. Cheng Dalei yelled cursing the rings and telling them how powerful they were. He ordered them to dismount and surrender and kneel down, as he would show them a move or two, which was enough for them to use for a lifetime. Gan Linying replied that there was nothing to be proud of when an empire fights an empire, and ridiculed them for being good at barking with no bite. Cheng Dalei's face darkened with anger and ordered his men to show them who they were messing with. A hoarse thump was heard while the city gates opened. Zhao Zilong came out holding his spear on his back and told the rings to get ready for round two. He introduced himself, telling them that he is Zhao Zilong from Chang Mountain. The Ring Tribe representative responded telling Zhao Zilong to watch him carefully as he would teach him some manners today. The man laughed, telling Cheng Dalei how dare he let a child come out to die. He told Zhao Zilong to go back to his home and drink milk for a few years and come back to the battlefield when he has grown up. One of the men from the Ring Tribe said that he would do it himself, while the others agreed that he could kill Zhao Zilong, and the other man mockingly said that he was already 60 years old, advising him that he better take a rest. Zhao Zilong stared at them, mumbling that the Ring Tribe was looking down on him. He told them that he would get serious and show them their place. The man charged and told his companions to let him behead Zhao Zilong's head first. One of his companions sighed and mumbled that he stole all the show for himself. The man furiously rushed towards Zhao Zilong, holding two swords, and told him that he was going to die by the sword. The man smiled as he was about to cut Zhao Zilong. However, Zhao Zilong watched the man carefully. Both warriors clashed, and Zhao Zilong came out triumphant, killing the man with his hundred birds spear fire spear. The ring tribe people's jaws dropped as their companion couldn't even last one round, while the others wondered what happened. Zhao Zilong yawned and mumbled that he was bored. He asked the ring tribe who else and told them to hurry up and come at him. Another man charged towards Zhao Zilong, telling him not to be so arrogant and to fight him instead. The man grit his teeth and told Zhao Zilong to die as he was about to pierce him with his spear. Meanwhile, at the city gates, Zhang Fei mumbled that another guy came who could stand two rounds against Zhao Zilong, and with just a few rounds, he was already knocked off his horse. Cheng Dalei stared intensely while his subordinates mumbled that the third one for the ringers lost, and so did the fourth. At the ring tribe's camp, Kai Mei was out of words while watching his men die one by one. A man was slashed down the camp in Zhao Zilong's fifth opponent, the seventh one just fell down. Zhao Zilong breathed out of exhaustion. Kai Mei mumbled that Zhao Zilong was so strong, as one of his men responded that Zhao Zilong was already exhausted, asking one of them as to who would go and kill him. Another man chimed in and told him that if he wanted to go, he could go, as they don't know if Zhao Zilong was just pretending. Meanwhile, at the city gate, Cheng Dalei ordered Zhao Zilong to come back. The men from the Toad Village cheered, mocking the Ring Tribe and telling them that they were too weak for the competition. The Ring Tribe's courage decreased and they couldn't respond back. Kai Mei told Cheng Dalei if he dared to come out and defeat him, he would retreat immediately if he could win against one of his next generals. Cheng Dalei responded, telling Kai Mei that he was the one who commands and does not try to be a hero, a truth so profound that the Ring Tribe would not understand. Kai Mei smiled and claimed that Cheng Dalei was afraid and that he should just open the gate and give up, as he would spare his life and give him the opportunity to lead horses and carry saddles. Humiliated, Cheng Dalei told Kai Mei to get lost. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dalei why he wouldn't go down and fight Kai Mei. Cheng Dalei's face darkened, and he cursed Zhu Shenji, asking him how much he hated him and that he wanted him dead. 
Zhu Shenji changed the topic and told Cheng Dale that now the enemy was down there in a chaotic formation, and their courage wasn't conducive. If he went into battle personally, he could certainly strengthen the courage of their army. Cheng Dale was contemplating and thought that he had set everyone up, and although they hadn't yet openly resisted, everyone had a reason to complain. He thought that if he went out and fought a little, maybe he could calm them down. However, resentment could also increase his standing. After a while, the city gates opened, and Cheng Dale told Kin Man and Zhao Zilong that they had to be ready to rescue him at any time as soon as he couldn't fight, to which Kin Man agreed. Cheng Dale yelled at the rings and asked them which one of them would die by his axe. Kai Mei mumbled that Cheng Dale came out and ordered his men to release the monster that had made a big mess earlier in their camp. The men approached a small cage. Kai Mei told the man that he would give him one chance. The men who were tightly cuffed stared intently. Kai Mei promised the man his freedom if he would kill Cheng Dale. The man didn't answer, and after a while, they loosened his ropes, and the man began to walk towards the battlefield. Cheng Dale wondered where they got a tall martial artist as he stared at the man ferociously. He claimed that the man could be Lin Chong. The man spoke and apologized to Cheng Dale, telling him that he had to suffer as he had a mission to complete. The system appeared with a notification that the man was indeed Lin Chong, which surprised Cheng Dale. However, Lin Chong's spear began to attack Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale barely dodged Lin Chong's spear and thought that it was quick. His eyes grew wide as he asked Lin Chong not to rush and hear him out. Lin Chong responded, telling him that he wasn't Master Lin and he didn't know him. He gripped his spear tightly and apologized as he leaped, swinging his spear at Cheng Dale. Kai Mei's subordinates mumbled that if nothing came up, Lin Chong should be able to take Cheng Dale down after a few more moves. Concerned, Kin Man told Zhao Zilong that Cheng Dale was at a disadvantage. Zhao Zilong responded that they must not rush into anything, that if they rush now, they would be forced to fight with the rings, and they wouldn't be able to save him. They could easily break through the gates after that. Cheng Dale was struggling and asked Lin Chong if he was willing to be a dog of the rings and kill his own people. Lin Chong didn't answer for a second, however, he responded that his master's son was stranded, and his whereabouts were unknown. He had to bring him back alive. He continued to attack Cheng Dale and apologized. Cheng Dale, who had just blocked Lin Chong's attack, asked him who his master's son was. Lin Chong asked Cheng Dale if he had seen a person with a majestic bearing and a chivalrous spirit called Lin Xiaoyu. As Cheng Dale blocked Lin Chong's attack, he told him that he knew his master's son, which left Lin Chong questioning. He informed him that Lin Xiaoyu was inside the city and at the time, he was his sworn brother, and if Lin Chong was Lin Xiaoyu's eldest brother, he was also his eldest brother. Lin Chong was confused that if Lin Xiaoyu was not captured by the Ring Tribe, how could his weapon fall into the hands of the Ring Tribe? As they continued fighting, Cheng Dale told Lin Chong if he didn't believe him, he would share something private that only Lin Xiaoyu knew. Lin Chong responded that he would like to hear what Cheng Dale could reveal. Cheng Dale proceeded to share everything about Lin Xiaoyu as he knew many things about him and asked Lin Chong if they could talk as they fought. Kin Man noticed that Lin Chong's attack slowed down, and Cheng Dale and Lin Chong were attacking back and forth. The fight continued as Cheng Dale informed Lin Chong that Lin Xiaoyu had a red birthmark on his chest and asked if he was willing to believe him now that he had shared everything. Lin Chong's eyes grew wide and asked Cheng Dale how he knew so many secrets about Lin Xiaoyu. He claimed that Lin Xiaoyu was homosexual. Lin Chong's face darkened as he mumbled that Lin Xiaoyu had such bad eyesight. Cheng Dale was annoyed by the sudden comment. He told Lin Chong that he would bash his head in. Cheng Dale coughed while retreating and told Lin Chong that he couldn't save him that day, so he would go back first and save him in a day or two. He rushed back and told him to withdraw as they couldn't distinguish who was winning, so he had to wait for him to go back to heal his stomach, as they would fight some other day. The faces of the people on both sides darkened in embarrassment, and they thought that it was obvious that Lin Chong could beat him to pulp, and he couldn't lift his head. Cheng Dale rushed to the gate and asked for his men to close the gate. The gate closed, the wooden bridge began to lift up. Cheng Dale hopped off his horse and told Kin Man and Zhao Zilong to summon all the chiefs and explain that there were important things to discuss. After a while at the gathering hall, Cheng Dale informed his subordinates that Lin Chong had been a long-lost friend of his who was trapped in the ring camp. He asked them to use their heads and tell him if they could get him out asking for any of their ideas. Liu Bei began by telling Cheng Dale that it was difficult to rescue Lin Chong in the ring camp and asked him if his friend was important. Looking at Liu Bei, Cheng Dale told him that Lin Chong was very important. Liu Bei suggested that they have to launch a large-scale attack, and start a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the rings and take the opportunity to snatch Lin Chong back. 
Another man suggested that they make a surprise attack on the enemy's camp at night and secretly get Lin Chong back from the enemy camp with a few experts. Some people added that the Ring tribe knew that their side would not leave the city, and that their defense may not be strict. One voiced out to take a few good masters as the chances of success were very high. While some argued that they didn't know the situation of the other party's camp and if they couldn't save Lin Chong they would lose more than they would gain. Some concluded to dig a tunnel and ask Cheng Dalei what his thoughts were. As he was sitting on his chair, Cheng Dalei voiced his opinion. He clenched his fist and told his people to keep thinking, regardless of the cost. Their next task was how to save Lin Chong. He informed them that he named the mission code name as Saving Soldier Lin Chong. Meanwhile, at the Ring Tribe camp, Meng Zian scolded Du Mao, telling him not to act rashly as he intended to let him show his skills at the critical moment. Their status could also be improved, however, Du Mao was too impulsive. Du Mao retorted that he could go and seek refuge with bandits as Meng Zian couldn't imagine that when he became a traitor, their future generations would not be able to lift their heads up in society. Meng Zian smiled and responded that Du Mao was just a villain and asked him who would look up to him in the empire. He went on to question Du Mao that when the emperor founded the empire, he was not regarded as a king by everyone. And that 20 years had passed, he wondered who would still dare not call him an emperor. Du Mao responded that he was not as eloquent as he was, he was just looking for Chen Dale to take revenge. And after he killed Cheng Dale, he would never stay in the Ring tribe for one more day. Meng Zian reminded Du Mao that he was the one who saved him in the first place, which aggravated Du Mao. Meng Zian chuckled, telling Du Mao that Yu State was not loyal and his son was unfilial to his parents and that he didn't think he should act righteous now. Then, all of a sudden, a drum was heard in the entire place. Kai Mei came out of his tent, wondering who it was and asked his men that they were going out to see. Cheng Dale, who rode his horse, raised his hand and told the scum of the Ring tribe that their grandfather Cheng Dale had arrived. He asked them which one of them was tired of living as they needed to come quickly so that he could kill them. Striding forward towards the enemy, Cheng Dale told the men of Ring that he had learned the art at the age of 3, mastered it at the age of 9, and was invincible at the age of 13. Kicking the North Sea back garden as no 180 or under could beat him. The men of the Ring tribe wondered what Cheng Dale was doing, while the others guessed that he wanted to fight them alone. Annoyed, Kai Mei ordered his men to kill Cheng Dale as he was bothering him. Hu Luxing held his weapon and told them that he was going to kill Cheng Dale. He charged towards Cheng Dale with an intent to kill. Cheng Dale asked the man to go back as he was not qualified to fight with him, and that he wanted Lin Chong to come out and fight him again for a few thousand rounds. The system appeared bearing information about Hu Luxian, a famous excellent warrior, and a leader of the Small Hill Division. Cheng Dale looked at Hu Luxing intensely and thought that the head of the Small Mountain Division might be enough to catch him. Hu Luxing swung his mace and told Cheng Dale to take his move. Cheng Dale also swung his axe, which Hu Luxing barely managed to block. His eyes widened as he thought that Cheng Dale had good blade skills and a heavy axe. He concluded that his opponent could not be underestimated. They turned at each other as Cheng Dale taunted Hu Luxing to come again and take his move as he swung his axe. Both of their weapons collided. Hu Luxing was sweating out of struggle as he thought that Cheng Dale moved so ferociously that he was going to lose. Kai Mei, who was watching from afar, mumbled that Cheng Dale fooled him the day before as he had a couple of tricks up his sleeve. Meanwhile, at the battlefield, the two were fighting with each other for 10 rounds. Struggling, Hu Luxing claimed that Cheng Dale's attacks were not as sharp as they were at the beginning. He believed that he was exhausted and that his opportunity had arrived. Cheng Dale retreated and told Hu Luxing that he was going back to fill his stomach and he would take his head another day. Enraged, Hu Luxing shouted at Cheng Dale, telling him not to go, he chased him. As he chased behind Cheng Dale, Hu Luxing angrily told him to stop running away. He claimed that he was so close to killing him and wondered why. Enraged, Hu Luxing's face darkened as he cursed in his thoughts that he was so close to catching up and wondered why there was always a gap between both of them. Cheng Dale leaped, which made Hu Luxing wonder why his horse could suddenly pick up speed and create a gap immediately. A system information popped up, stating that the horse Cheng Dale was riding was an excellent slender horse and had a skill for running away, getting a speed bonus when running away. Kai Mei shouted at Hu Luxing, ordering him to stop chasing and come back. Cheng Dale screamed Kin Man and Zhao Zilong's names as he rushed towards the city gates. He asked them why they weren't doing anything yet and wondered what they were waiting for. Kin Man came out first, and behind him were Zhao Zilong and Gao Fei Hu. Hu Luxing's eyes widened as he was intercepted by Kin Man's spear. He barely blocked the spear, however, Kin Man forced him off of his horse. Zhao Zilong, who was holding a rope, tied down Hu Luxing. 
who believed that his life was over, Gao Fei who helped Zhao Zilong in tying Hu Luxing. They hastily entered the city gate, ordering their men to close it. Enraged, Kai Mei knew that it was a trap and ordered his men to attack the city. The rings charged towards the city, bringing with them their ladders. Kai Mei ordered his archer units and catapult units to get ready. Gan Linying shouted at Kai Mei, asking him not to shoot arrows as Hu Luxing was hanging at the top of the city gates. Cheng Dale claimed that they should shoot their own people, as the ring tribe liked to use catapults, bows, and arrows and serve them the same sauce. The siege lasted another day and night. After leaving hundreds of bodies behind, Kai Mei finally returned unsuccessfully. A voice was heard at the top of the city gates, addressing Kai Mei that if he wanted to save Hu Luxing, he should cut the crap. Cheng Dale asked him to release Lin Chong, and they were going to exchange one for the other. Kai Mei gritted his teeth and thought that Cheng Dale had challenged Lin Chong to a fight today, claiming that it turned out he didn't want to kill him. Instead, he wanted to save him. He reasoned that the Small Hill Division was not a small force in the Northern Ringer's division, and at the moment the Small Hill Division's leader fell into the hands of the enemy. Kai Mei thought that if he didn't save Hu Luxiao, the Small Hill Division would turn against him. Kai Mei suggested that his side would release Lin Chong. On the other hand, he would let Hu Lu go down along the wall at the same time, let them go over by themselves, and the soldiers on both sides must not take a single step, which Cheng Dale agreed to. Hu Luxing walked toward the Ring tribe while Lin Chong moved towards the city gates. Qing Dale ordered Zhao Zilong to lift Lin Chong up. Zhao Zilong threw the rope and began lifting up Lin Chong as they noticed that he was badly wounded, and they ordered to take him to Liu Bei. After a while, Cheng Dale thought that he had finally completed the conditions, and he began to tap the screen to upgrade the village. A light glowed. A voice was heard stating that Cheng Dale was a righteous boy. The system appeared and told Cheng Dale that under his attentive leadership, the village is thriving. The conditions have been met, and she congratulated him for bringing the village to level 3. She went on to say that she saw that he was righteous and had extraordinary resources, and he had proven to her that he had a heart strong enough to use great power. A light glowed from the tip of the finger of the system as he told Cheng Dale that she would give him the power that can destroy thousands of armies. She asked him to take it while pointing the light on his head. Cheng Dale gained power up, physical improvement, combat movements, and combat abilities were merged with the host, and the village owner leveled up to the top level. A notification popped stating that level 3 village was reached and all skills increased by one, and the village rewarded with one ability. Archery improvement for archers and the probability of producing excellent weapons in the forge is increased. A system information popped, and the character summon platform upgraded, in every summon consuming 100,000 fear points, one guaranteed top character after 10 summons, and he would have a chance to get one supreme warrior with 10 million in exchange. Both the system and the gacha machine informed Cheng Dale that the new system store is officially open today. Each time he entered the system store, 10,000 fear points would be deducted from his account. And fear points could be used to buy weapons and equipment, props, martial arts, sundries, and population. And that the items sold in the newly opened store are only rated between average and excellent. The system welcomed Cheng Dale to the new system store. The system informed Cheng Dale about the items in the store, including the Da Hai Dan, the flesh and bones of the living corpse, priced at 80 fear value. A weapon, twin ring knife, was priced at 60, and the mount, crow horse, was priced at 200, while the 500 refugees were priced at 500. And the 100 soldiers manual, which recorded the training methods of various types of soldiers, was priced at 3,000 fear points. And the system continued. Cheng Dale's face was distorted after he heard the expensive prices. He asked the system if there was anything that cost less than 100,000 fear points, to which the system answered that she was going to take a look. The system searched as Cheng Dale watched behind her. She told Cheng Dale that she found something, an ordinary cut wounds medicine, priced at 5 fear points, and a box of gunpowder powder, priced at 10 fear value. As she told him the cheapest thing, she told him that after purchase, he could choose the place where the item appeared and enjoy the quality service of home delivery. Cheng Dale claimed that 100,000 fears for one box of gunpowder were cheap as he believed that it would be the most useful for now. He glared at the cut wound medicine as its role was to speed up the recovery of injuries. Cheng Dale remembered that before Lin Chong was saved, he had been tortured by the Ring tribe and got serious injuries, and the medicine was just what he needed. Pointing his fingers at the medicine and telling the system that he wanted the item, to which the system agreed and asked him if he needed anything else. A beep noise deducted Cheng Dale's fear points to 500,000. 
The system smiled in gratitude and told Cheng Dalei that they would see each other next time. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei held the medicine in his hand and informed Liu Bei to use it on his brothers. Liu Bei recognized that it was Mr. Zhang Jing's incised wound medicine and asked Cheng Dalei where he got it from. Cheng Dalei said that he bought it from an immortal and hurried Liu Bei to save the people. After some time at the top of the city gates, one of Cheng Dalei's men reported that the city wall was repaired and that it seemed to be stronger than the previous one. Cheng Dalei rubbed his hands on the wall as he thought that the repair speed was much faster than before. He realized that it was the skill of the mountain fortress. As he inspected the wall, Lin Chong appeared, asking for Lin Xiaoyu. Cheng Dalei said not to worry as Lin Xiaoyu was on a very important mission and was not in any kind of danger. Lin Chong's face stiffened as he asked him again where Lin Xiaoyu was. Cheng Dalei sweated a little, however. He pointed out that Lin Xiaoyu was over there. Lin Chong, still confused, asked him what. Cheng Dalei informed him that Lin Xiaoyu was on the top of the Bullhorn Peak, using the tree as a signal to show the direction of the Ring Tribe's advancement. He pointed to the tree and said that in that way, if the Ring Tribe made any move, they could know in advance. Lin Chong's face darkened in anger and shouted to Cheng Dalei, asking if he wanted Lin Xiaoyu to die. Cheng Dalei assured him that his mission was not that dangerous and that no one could find him there as there were big trees at the top of the peak making it difficult to see him. Besides, no one would look to the sky all day. Enraged, Lin Chong clenched his fist and told Cheng Dalei that it was good not to be found when you were alone. But if you were found, you would be dead. He told Cheng Dalei that since it was not dangerous, he should go there instead. Cheng Dalei informed him that the mountains and rivers were shattered, and all the people became destitute and homeless, the land was dying every day. He went on that many people had already died in his fortress, and their people still opened the gates to collect the corpses, and they already knew that they would not be able to return alive. And if the Ring tribe attacked them while they were collecting bodies, he doubted that those who were collecting the bodies would be able to get in. The reason was that they knew that opening the gate meant giving the Ring tribe a chance. He added that once the Toad village was breached, 5,000 lives were bound to become ghosts of the Ring tribe's sword. Cheng Dalei's face darkened as he said that he would die, as well as Lin Chong, Xiao Yu would also die, and that the both of them had no choice. Lin Chong, who was listening, didn't mutter a single word. Meanwhile, at the Bullhorn Peak, the men inside the city noticed that the tree was moving. Cheng Dalei screamed, ordering everyone to get ready as the Ring Tribe was coming again. Taking advantage of the evening and sunset, the Ring Tribe attacked on a large scale. Many Ring Tribe warriors were willing to die, risking their lives to charge. Several times the city was in danger of being lost. The people of Toad Village had already put aside their fears and resisted the attack till death. Kin Man, Zhao Zilong, and Lin Chong each led a team to guard the city. The three generals moved together, dancing on the battlefield with their killing dance. Kai Mei's eyes were wide open as his men mumbled that Lin Chong was seriously injured, and he wondered how he recovered so quickly. The people from the Ring tribe also were confused on why couldn't their stone rocks break their city walls anymore and ordered them to load up bigger ones. Someone also screamed to hit them harder, while the others warned the others to watch for the Toad Village arrows and raise their shield as their arrows were much more accurate. The battle lasted for a day and night, but the Ring tribe returned without success. In the following days, Kaime launched a dozen more attacks on the city, sacrificing countless lives but still he could not break the gates. In short, the Toad Village had held for 17 days. The city walls hadn't been breached. Many forces sent out scouts. Countless eyes fixed their gaze on King Niu Mountain. One of the scouts noticed that the rings had retreated and wondered if the Toad Village had been broken through yet, while his companion didn't believe so. They were ordered to send the message back quickly, reporting about the seventh attack and going on. At Jizu the city lord's mansion, a man reported that the 11th attack on the Toad Village by the Army of the Rings was also unsuccessful, while his superior said to continue to investigate. At the Yuzhu city lord's mansion, Yang Long asked his subordinate what the situation was and if the Toad Village had been broken through. The man reported that the Toad Village was able to defend against the Rings. Yang Longting was sweating as he believed that they could fight back again and asked when exactly they would be broken through. Meanwhile at Qingzhu, Tiani City, a soldier was looking for his city lord. He bowed and reported to Fang Bashan that according to those who fled to the port, the rings had not yet broken through King Niu Mountain. Fang Bashan questioned if they were still unbroken, and wondered if Cheng Dalei's band of mountain bandits were really holding the fort. Doubtful, Fang Bashan asked the soldier if the Toad Village could stop 10,000 elite soldiers with their small army of rabble. The soldier asked Fang Bashan if they should go back, which made Fang Bashan question him. 
he explained that they could lead the remnants of the army and attack the rings from the outside with the toad village from inside. The ring tribe would be attacked from front and back and they would definitely be defeated by their army, and Fang Boshan, the city lord, would have a great success. Fang Boshan asked his men if he was not crazy, as he was talking about the ring tribe. Kaio Yi didn't answer, however, he wondered what was so awesome about the rings. Fang Boshan ordered Kaio Yi to keep scouting, and said as soon as the ring went south they could pull out immediately to which Kaio Yi agreed to. Meanwhile, a young boy asked his master why they had to go to King Niu Mountain as it was a war zone. The master said that recently fewer and fewer people had fled to Kingju. He believed that there were only two possibilities for the situation. He went on to say that it was either the rings had already killed their way through and were currently taking over the city, or Cheng Dale was still defending the Toad Village. The young boy believed that the second one was probably too implausible. The master replied that the mountain bandits became outlaws and more professionals, but the overall quality of their soldiers was by no means comparable to the regular army. The boy claimed that the armed soldiers of the capital and the soldiers of the other provinces could not stop the rings, and the weakest mountain bandits stopped the strongest riders of the rings. He asked his master what happened to the rings. The famous generals in the region trembled with fear when they heard about the rings, but only a group of mountain bandits dared to fight back. The master answered that countless youthful leaders of the empire also thought so. Some people didn't believe the rumors and wanted to try to fight the rings and wondered what was the big deal with the rings. He went on to say that the result was often more losses than victories, and it was not even an exaggeration to say that out of a hundred battles, a hundred were lost. And after countless failures, it was considered that the ring tribe was unbeatable. Time passed, and if the young leaders of that time had not died on the battlefield, they should also have had gray hairs on their heads now. The master said that at that point, when a young man wanted to fight the ring, he angrily retorted with the phrase, that's the ring tribe, and no one had even given an answer to the question, what's the matter with the rings? The master continued and told the boy that actually, everyone knew the answer to the question, but no one was qualified to answer it for 30 years. As they saw the vast horizon, he told the boy that on that day, they would go to the King Nui Mountain to see if he could write down the answer to that question. The master rubbed his beard and mumbled that the question was not complicated, and the answer was also simple and required only a few words, but no one could put it on paper, because the answer must come from the pen of an elite soldier, with the great rivers and mountains as paper, with blood as ink, and with a clean victory as the final word. The rings were nothing. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village city gates, Zhu Shenji told Cheng Dale to look. He mumbled that the rings were retreating as they were taking down their tents. Zhu Shenji suggested storming and then taking advantage of their lack of preparation to really crush them. Cheng Dali's eyes narrowed, and he said no need to rush. The ring tribe retreated. Zhu Shenji said to give them the order to pursue them. If they would not pursue them, they would fly far away. Cheng Dali asked him not to worry as they were trying to draw them out. He noticed that the treetops shifted southwest, and the opposite, he believed that the enemy's retreat was actually a strategy to lure the troops, and once they left the line of sight, they would surround the King Niu Mountains. Cheng Dale smiled and ordered Zhu Shenji to go down and leave the city gate wide open. Zhu Shenji asked if he was going to send troops. Cheng Dale snapped his finger and wondered what Zhu Shenji meant, as when the rings returned, they should prepare more crossbows and heavy stones and be prepared to give them a good treatment. The rings marched towards the vast forest. Kaime asked his subordinates if they came after them, to which the man replied not yet. He ordered the man to continue to observe. Under the crescent moon, Lin Xiaoyu thought that the ring tribe was still camped within the vicinity of King Niu Mountain. He wished for Cheng Dale not to chase them out. Meanwhile, at the ring tribe's camp, Hu Luxing said to Kaime that with the empire's thirst for greatness and success, when the enemy retreated, they should have gone out of the city and pursued the routed soldiers. He wondered if the Empire was aware of their plans as they were still calm at the time. Kaime questioned how it was possible. How could they know that their retreat was real or fake as they didn't have a farsighted person? Doubtful, Hu Luxing asked Kaime why they weren't coming out. Kaime responded that even if they didn't come out, they would just kill them when they were careless. Suddenly, a man came running reporting to Kaime that the Toad Village was crowded inside and seemed to be celebrating. Kaime smirked, mumbling that it seemed that they had been scared out of their wits, and even if they retreated, they dared not to come out. The rings waited out, as another report came in that the number of soldiers at Toad Village gates had dropped to 100. The man was ordered to scout again. Another report that the guards were down to 50, and another to scout again. 
Then the third report came as the man said that there were only a dozen of soldiers at the top of the city, and the city gates were open as they were gathering the weapons outside the city gates. Kai Mei stood up as his face darkened, smirking. He told his man that they were going to attack the city and kill them all. Meanwhile, at the city gates, men were gathering corpses and weapons. All of a sudden, they noticed a rumble and looked from where it came from. They shouted that an enemy was coming and told their other companion to get inside the city. Zhao Feibao smiled in relief and yelled that they were finally here. The ring tribe gathered and charged towards the city gates with an intent to kill. They successfully infiltrated the gates. Kaimei yelled the cavalry was inside and ordered his warriors of the steppe to kill them all and massacre the city. Men from the rings screamed to kill. At the top of the gate, Cheng Dale ordered the gate closed. As the ring charged, a metal was heard clacking and rumbling as the gate closed. They left confused and were ordering their men to attack the city. Cheng Dale summoned a siege hammer and instructed his archers to load and release. As a barrage of arrows fell down, the ring's eyes grew wide open. Kai Mei yelled in despair as he realized it was a trap and things were not looking good. He ordered his men to retreat, but it was too late as the arrows pierced some of his men and horses. Inside the city, Hu Luxing screamed to seize the gates and clear the way for the follow-up troops. However, their horses fell into a trap. The rings cursed as they fell in a trap. Hu Luxing ordered his men to control their horses and not to move as the enemy was coming. Warriors from the Toad Village held their spears and yelled to kill the rings and attack their horses. The cavalry who lost their momentum could only be attacked by the well-trained spearmen. Hu Luxing and his horse were stabbed by countless spears as they called it heaven subduing. At the top of the gate, Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale if they should leave a survivor. Cheng Dale covered his mouth and answered what he meant by leaving a survivor. He ordered him to tell the archer to kill everyone. Zhu Shenji noticed that the handkerchief embroidery Cheng Dale was using was exquisite. Cheng Dale asked him whether it was true, after he told him that Su Ying embroidered it but that he didn't like to use it. Moving back to the battlefield, the archers kept releasing their arrows as many bodies of the rings lay dead on the ground. Kai Mei ordered his men to withdraw. Wounded, Kai Mei looked back at the city. Cheng Dale asked Kai Mei to stay a bit longer and asked him if he was satisfied with his meal. Enraged, Kai Mei gritted his teeth and threatened Cheng Dale that he would kill him and chop him a thousand times. Cheng Dale called him an uneducated barbarian and asked him what qualifications he had to bark in front of him as he was a defeated man. He pointed at him and said that those who are unrestrained would be stabbed, and those who violate their country would be pearled even if they were far away. And as he continued to taunt him for dating a beast who ate the raw flesh of birds and beasts to try to get their nation's weapon, he declared that he would punish him today in place of heaven. He ended his speech that Kai Mei was already defeated, to which Kai Mei's jaw dropped in humiliation. Kai Mei lost consciousness and fell. Confused, Cheng Dale thought that the first time he saw this was when he was a student. The rings gathered around Kai Mei's tent, asking how he was. Someone mentioned that his illness was troublesome. He informed them that it was a heart disease and a heart disease needed heart medicine. The man said to Kai Mei that the medicine was ready, as he would get well after drinking it. Kai Mei sat down holding a cup and looked down, wondering how they could see through his plan. He speculated if it was because their retreat had flaws or if it was because the other side had farsighted eyes and knew their movements. Kai Mei's hands were shaking as he couldn't see through it, and wondered why the enemies knew everything about their movements. The cup in his hands fell and shattered. In his depressive state, he thought that after being besieged for nearly 20 days, the 10,000 cavalry used to beat any type of enemies they encountered. On the contrary, this time their side suffered heavy casualties and now he had only 4,000 survivors left. He questioned himself how he could face his tribesmen and his father now. A man showed up calling Kai Mei brother. Jin Wendao, the ninth prince of the Northern Ringers, said that Kai Mei was really disappointing. Kai Mei asked Jin Wendao why he was here. Jin Wendao stepped forward and said he didn't need to come in person if Kai Mei were more useful. He pointed his fan at Kai Mei's head and asked him if he got what his father wanted. Kai Mei denied and said that the enemy was very cunning. Jin Wendao responded that he was still boasting in front of their father after 20 days of fighting, and he still couldn't break through the city. He informed Kai Mei that he would take over everything now that he was here. Kai Mei assured Jin Wendao that his illness was not critical and he could still lead the army. As he slapped the fan, Kai Mei said he would break through the Toad Village and get what their father wanted if he gave him more time. Jin Wengdao retorted that he would teach him what war was all about and that it was not about his illness, but Kai Mei's brain, as he was too stupid. He looked down on Kai Mei and told him that if he couldn't die from his illness, 
He just needed to keep his eyes open and watch how he broke through the city in three days. Outside the Ring tribe camp, Ring men ordered Meng Zian to clean up the horse manure. The men mocked him, calling him weak-kneed. Meng Zian huffed in exhaustion as he pushed a cart full of dirt. He arrived at a quiet area and stopped and ate his food, thinking that he was now used to that kind of insult as he did it every day. Meng Zian thought that if he got a chance to lead the army into the Toad Village, he would be able to kill Cheng Dale. He believed that he could still get Liu Jiahan back, but changed his mind as she was not worth it and it was better to kill her. Sighing, Meng Zian claimed that the Ring Tribe and Toad Village were the same, as it was all about guys. He heard a rustle from the peak. His eyes widened and noticed that the tree at the top of the hill was moving. He claimed that there was someone up there. Sweating, Meng Zian realized what it meant. After a while, he climbed at the Bullhorn Peak and saw Lin Xiaoyu sitting. Realizing that he knew Lin Xiaoyu was, Meng Zian smirked as he thought that it seemed that the opportunity that he had been waiting for had appeared. He slowly approached Lin Xiaoyu, however, the wind made a rustling noise. Lin Xiaoyu turned to look, and questioned if what he saw was an illusion. Back at the Ring Tribe camp, Jin Wangdao asked Meng Zian if he was sure. Kneeling, Meng Zian said he would be stabbed by 10,000 swords if there was a single lie in his words. Jin Wangdao asked him if he was from the south, to which Meng Zian didn't respond. He asked him why he wanted to join them. Meng Zian answered that he had hatred for the bandit for taking his wife and he couldn't forget it. Jin Wangdao smiled and told Meng Zian that from now on he could be his groom. Meng Zian was perplexed and questioned what he meant by groom, thinking that his report was so important but he only got a groom position. Jin Wangdao tapped Meng Zian's head and assured him there would be a better position for him when he really kills Cheng Dale, to which Meng Zian agreed. Jin Wangdao strode off and chuckled and muttered the word interesting twice. Meanwhile, at the Bullhorn Peak, Lin Xiaoyu was still sitting. Then suddenly a group of ring men appeared. Lin Xiaoyu's face distorted as he noticed that someone was coming and that the earlier movement wasn't an illusion. He held his weapon and remembered what Cheng Dale said that if he took the job, he had to take a risk of being discovered and if the situation was not good he had to retreat as soon as possible. The iron breaking spear with attributes the broken arm refined by blacksmith Zhu of Toad Village. Lin Xiaoyu claimed that it was not a good idea to run away at the slightest hint of trouble, and since there's a chance he could drive the ring's tribe away and save the people from a worse situation. And even if thousands of warriors surrounded the mountain, as a warrior he would die fighting. Under the crescent moon, Lin Xiaoyu was surrounded by the rings. The ring had climbed the bullhorn peak. Lin Xiaoyu realized that the way down the mountain was blocked. He leaped towards a group of rings and thought he would break his way out. A group of rings flew from Lin Xiaoyu's attack. The rings yelled that they had found Lin Xiaoyu, while the others told everyone to hurry up. As Lin Xiaoyu charged towards the ring, he thought that a man with average talent who wasn't trying hard but still wanted to be a warrior might have been a delusion. The rings readied their rope and mumbled that Jin Wendao had ordered them to capture Lin Xiaoyu alive. Lin Xiaoyu thrust his spear, calling it the threefold spear wave breaker. As he fought, he thought that holding his spear today felt different from before. He wondered if it was because he was doing the right thing. Lin Xiaoyu claimed the newly forged iron weapon seemed to have an inexplicable power passing into one's body, in addition to the wet cold. He pierced two ring men in one thrust, his heart was more stable, and he had sharper eyes and bursting strength. The rings gritted their teeth as they saw what had happened. Lin Xiaoyu smirked as he continued stabbing and unleashed his skill, Spear Wave Breaker three folds, killing quietly, just the occasional scream before death. The futile struggle to kill, and ultimately just a fight of animals was endless. Many of the ring men fell dead, however, they still charged at Lin Xiaoyu. Exhausted, Lin Xiaoyu believed that it was probably almost over. He wondered if anyone would know what he had done if he took a leap. Maybe he could be like those who worshipped before him, in the mouth of the storyteller. The edge of the cliff broke where Lin Xiaoyu was standing. The rings watched him as he fell from the peak. While falling, on a certain day, in a certain month, in a certain year, the young warrior Lin Xiaoyu had fought against the Ring tribe, but was defeated and fell off the cliff. It turned out that every warrior belonged to the cliff. Lin Xiaoyu's eyes looked dead as he believed perhaps Lin Chong could find his bones under the cliff, as he was still looking for him. The rings watched him as he fell, Lin Xiaoyu released his spear. He thought that it may also have been able to exchange a few tears of the lady in the boudoir. Then perhaps no one would remember, as it didn't matter. Seconds passed, a lasso appeared, tying around Lin Xiaoyu's body. The rope tightened, making Lin Xiaoyu's eyes widen. Jin Wengdao, who held the rope, asked him if he wanted to die. He said that it would not be that easy. Jin Wengdao, ninth prince of the Northern Ring tribe and who was good at using a lasso. At the top of the city gate, Cheng Dale watched over the ring camp. 
He claimed that the Ring tribe's troops were increasing and that at least a few thousand more people had come. After such a big defeat, their army strength increased instead of decreasing, and no matter how he thought, it was not normal. The rings marched approaching the gate. In front, Jin Wendao asked if Cheng Dalei was the general of King Niu Mountain, the lord of the imperial city, and the holder of the king's seal of the Yuzhu state, the divine axe general of the immortal art, and the toad king who guarded the King Niu Mountain. Cheng Dalei told him that he was correct and asked Jin Wendao if he was another traitor of the empire as he saw him dressed like that. Jin Wendao introduced himself as the Ninth Prince and said that he had heard that Cheng Dalei was a great scholar, martial artist, and righteous person, and he knew that he was not that famous as him but still, meeting him was better than being famous. Cheng Dalei smiled, responding that when wandering around the world, the most important thing was the word righteous and claimed that Jin Wendao was a good man that made him very happy. He asked him to hurry up and retreat, as he would spare his life today. Jin Wendao grinned and said that he prepared a small gift and maybe after he saw his gift, perhaps Cheng Dalei would change his mind as it was the first time they met. Cheng Dalei scoffed and told Jin Wendao that he was still very polite. Jin Wendao ordered to bring his gift. Cheng Dalei's face darkened. Lin Xiaoyu, who was tied down in a cart. Cheng Dalei's face wrinkled in anger as he muttered Lin Xiaoyu's name, who he saw wounded. In the Toad Village Wall, Lin Chong shouted Xiao Yu's name as he was surprised that Xiao Yu had been captured by the Ring Tribe. Cheng Dalei quickly ordered Kin Man and Sai Long to hold Lin Chong down, emphasizing the urgency of the situation. Now lying helpless and restrained beneath the combined strength of Kin Man and Sai Long, Lin Chong couldn't contain his frustration, cursing at Cheng Dalei. With a furrowed brow, Lin Chong asks Cheng Dalei, questioning the assurances about the no danger for Xiao Yu. Cheng Dalei's response was a tense silence. His annoyance was evident as his jaw clenched and his eyes narrowed in frustration. With a steely gaze directed at Jin Wendao, Cheng Dalei asks Jin Wendao about his intention. Jin Wendao, displaying a playful smile, invoked the concept of the word justice serves as Cheng Dalei's guide, which is why Cheng Dalei cannot bear to witness his friend's suffering. He requests Cheng Dalei to open the gate, promising to return to his friends once inside. While maintaining a stern demeanor, Cheng Dalei contemplates the concept of negotiation, emphasizing the importance of proposing acceptable terms. Cheng Dalei raises concerns that letting them in might lead to slaughtering the people in the cities. Jin Wendao was seen wearing a silly smile, clarifying to Cheng Dalei that he might have misunderstood him and that it was not a negotiation. His facade shifted suddenly menacing turn as he cleared that it was a threat. Raising his handheld fan with authority, he called out Meng Ziyun and ordered him to give Cheng Dalei a taste of their intentions. Meng Ziyun, in response to Jin Wendao's command, displayed a sinister smile on his face. Out of nowhere, Xiao Yu's legs were ruthlessly stabbed by Meng Ziyun, putting him in agonizing screams that pierced the air. Cheng Dalei has his face contorted in a grimace of annoyance. As he called out to Xiao Yu, his concern mingled with frustration. With anger simmering, Cheng Dalei directed a menacing threat at Meng Ziyun. He gritted his teeth in anger, and vowed to catch, chop, and feed him to the pigs. Amidst the tension, Jin Wendao cuts in as he slowly unfurls his handheld fan. He mentions his status as a prince and expresses that he has a good heart and can no longer endure watching the situation. Wearing a sardonic smirk, Jin Wendao continues his statement, demanding to Cheng Dalei that the city be opened and surrendered within three days, or he would have Xiao Yu hacked to death before his eyes. Shortly after that moment, a gathering took place inside the Toad Village to discuss the unfolding situation of Xiao Yu. A person then spoke about how Xiao Yu shared life and death with them, and they could not let him fall into the hands of the enemy. Rescue was imperative. Some expressed doubts about the practicality of saving someone from the rings, and some questioned whether they could save their own people. Others voiced out that they must not surrender to the rings or everyone in the village would die, while others suggested the possibility of digging a tunnel to reach Xiao Yu as he was tied up near the city wall. Some observed that it appeared as if the only viable option remaining was the daring approach of a raw raid, but they raised a valid concern, questioning the likelihood that the opposing side would win. Sharing an insightful perspective, Liu Bei acknowledged the difficulty of this mission comparing it to their previous rescue of Liu Chong. It was mentioned that last time the enemy had been unaware of Liu Chong's significance, but now, with Xiao Yu, the enemy must have appointed much stronger guards. Continuing Liu Bei's analysis, he pointed out the possibility that even if they managed to capture an enemy general, the enemy may not have been willing to exchange Xiao Yu. A person argued for sacrificing Xiao Yu to exploit the ring's weakness in siege warfare. 
However, Fei Bao opposed his suggestion and issued a stern warning if he said one more word about saving, vowing to throw him out. Undeterred, the same person reiterated his point that once the war began, more people would have to be sacrificed. Amidst the heated discussion, San Yuan asked Cheng Dale what they should do. Cheng Dale, visibly burdened by the weight of the situation, gripped his chair tightly. He emphasized the need to save Xiao Yu without further debate. His face contorted with determination as he shifted the discussion toward how to save Xiao Yu. Meanwhile, in another section of the Ring Tribe Camp's tent, Fu Delay offered some food to Little Cherry, explaining how hard it had been for him to get it. Fu Delay shared his plans for Cherry's safety, reassuring her that he would soon send her away to safety under the protection of Big Brother Kaime, which Cherry confirmed. Curiously, Cherry inquired about the increased number of people in the camp while nibbling on her food. Fu Delay explained that Jin Wendao with his troops came over and took the position of commander-in-chief, and all the troops gathered by Kaime became Jin Wendao's people. He cautioned Cherry not to go out lately, emphasizing that it was not safe outside. Cherry asked if Jin Wendao was scary. In response to her query about the ninth brother, Fu Delay explained that all the princes who wanted the throne were terrible. Mentioning his father, the king of the Northern Ringers, had many children. Continuing his explanation, Fu Delay stated that Hull was the most popular. However, he was killed by who knows who, and only then the other ten brothers had a chance to fight for the throne. Everyone was trying to find a way to draw the tribes of the grasslands to themselves, and that's why there was a big chaos. In an effort to reassure Cherry, Fu Delay shared his plan, stating that he would send her to the only princess of the rings, loved by their father and with whom he had a good relationship, ensuring Cherry's safety. Cherry expressed concern about Fu Delay's asking what about him, to which he responded, asserting that he was just an illegitimate son and not a threat to their claims to the throne, thus he would not be in danger. Fu Delay made a heartfelt promise to Cherry, assuring her that after her departure, he would come to find her after the war, to which Cherry responded simply, acknowledging his words. In the meantime, outside the camp tent, a man asked others if there weren't military prostitutes in the camp, expressing his discontent. One of them reported that all had been driven to the siege before, and other slave girls were the property of the chiefs. Frustrated, the man expressed his discontent, feeling mistreated despite following the ninth prince this far. Others shared their intentions, stating that after finishing the battle in the city, they would be going to do it really hard. The conversation took a turn when one of the men mentioned rumors of hidden beauty in the tent of the useless prince Fudele, and asked the man who was introduced as Muki if he was interested. Muki was a bit surprised but expressed his interest asking his subordinate to take him there. After a couple of minutes, Muki quickly made his way to Fu Delay's tent and urgently called out for Fu Delay, inquiring if Prince Fu Delay was there. Fu Delay, upon hearing the call, decided to go outside to check. He instructed Cherry to remain hidden and not to be seen by outsiders, to which Cherry acknowledged it. He put his hands to his swords as he prepared himself to approach Muki. Muki, with a sly grin, proposed a trade to Fu Delay. He offered a good knife in exchange for what he referred to as Fu Delay's woman. Fu Delay denied any knowledge of a woman, feigning ignorance about the presence of slaves. Undeterred, Muki persisted, insisting that there was a beauty hidden within Fu Delay's tent. He suggested lending her for a night since his men in the infantry camp were excited to let off some steam. Muki sweetened the deal, promising Fu Delay a cow, and placed his hands on Fu Delay's shoulder. However, Fu Delay vehemently denied that there were nothing there, and told Muki to find someone else, even if he appeared scared with a snarling expression. Growing frustrated, Muki accused Fu Delay of being shameless and began to choke him. Fu Delay, despite being choked, reminded Muki of his royal status as the Prince of the Northern Ringers King. He suggested that Muki should feel guilty for insulting his superiors. Muki, unimpressed by Fu Delay's status as a prince, justified his actions, stating that the grassland people only respected true warriors and not nobility. Cherry, hidden nearby, anxiously watched the confrontation. Fu Delay's thoughts raced, wondering why Cherry was looking outside and urging her to go back while resisting Muki's choke. Muki noticed a sudden movement that caused the curtain to shrink and remarked with curiosity. He released his grip on Fu Delay, a smile forming on his face. Muki commented that it appeared as though a little finch was hidden inside. Muki then slowly approached the tent, expressing curiosity about what the hidden person might taste like. Meanwhile, Fu Delay, who had a hard time standing up after Muki released him from choking, kept coughing. Fu Delay firmly warned that if Muki took a single step inside, it would cost him his life, gripping his swords with determination. Somewhere at the ring's camp tent, Muki confronted Fu Delay after the latter's threat and repeatedly asked about what was just said. 
Despite struggling to stand, Fu Delay managed to convey a threat, expressing his intent to kill Mu Qi, even though he stuttered to say it. Mu Qi's eyebrow wrinkled with anger as he commented on Fu Delay growing a pear. Suddenly, he kicked Fu Delay in the stomach, telling him that he was a piece of crap. Fu Delay couldn't suppress a wince. Blood escaped his lips in response to the powerful kick. With disdain in his voice, Mu Qi lectured Fu Delay for drawing a sword against him when he couldn't even hold it properly. Continuing his taunts, Mu Qi stated that his actions were merely a form of respect while toying with one of Fu Delay's slave girls. Despite his aggression, Mu Qi mentioned that if it was not for Kai Mei's sake, he could have killed him otherwise. He placed his foot on Fu Delay's head as a display of dominance. Fu Delay, despite his injuries, defiantly forbade Mu Qi from entering the tent while shakily gripping one of Mu Qi's legs as he did so. Mu Qi grew annoyed and demanded that Fu Delay get out of the way, kicking him once more. Fu Delay threw away. As Fu Delay spat out some blood after the kick and Mu Qi walked back to the tent, while Fu Delay was lying on the ground. Witnessing the fight, one man noted to Fu Delay that he dared to challenge the right-hand man of the Ninth Prince, which was Mu Qi. Another man remarked on the recklessness, commenting about some madman who did not care about life in the infantry battalion. A person suggested whether they should inform Boss Kai Mei and asked others if Fu Delay had not been killed. However, someone dismissed the idea, stating that Kai Mei wouldn't care about the situation and they should mind their own business as they decided to leave. Another person downplayed the seriousness of the situation, noting that Fu Delay had only lost a woman. Inside the tent, Cherry's scream pierced outside the tent, filled with fear. Muki, wearing a perverted laugh, taunted Cherry, urging her not to run away. He shouted in triumph as he captured her. Cherry, terrified while resisting, pleaded for him to release her, her voice filled with desperation. Muki yelped in pain, seemingly bitten by Cherry. He retaliated by kicking her, causing her to fall to the ground. Frustrated, Muki kicked Cherry again and berated her. Cherry, in agony, called out for Fu Delay to save her while her voice trembled. Fu Delay, upon hearing Cherry's desperate plea, recalled every statement of his brother, Kai Mei, and slowly began to stand up. Kai Mei's words echoed in Fu Delay's mind, emphasizing that Cherry was now Fu Delay's responsibility, instructing him to protect her as she was considered his possession. He also stressed that Fu Delay should draw his sword if anyone attempted to take something from him. With anger burning inside Fu Delay, he also remembered Cherry asking him if she would be protected. As Fu Delay's expression darkened with anger, he reaffirmed his role, asserting himself as Cherry's master. He made a solemn pledge to protect Cherry, vowing that with Fu Delay, no one could take her away or harm her. Inside the tent, Muki forcibly tore Cherry's clothes as she resisted. Fear filled Cherry's face, while Muki wore a perverted grin. Right then behind Muki, Fu Delay appeared, ready to strike with his sword. Fu Delay's thoughts echoed his determination to protect Cherry's safety, firmly believing that with him, no one could tear her away, and no one could hurt her. As the rage he felt, Fu Delay intensely swung the sword at Muki's back, causing him to spew blood. Muki managed to turn around but was caught off guard as Fu Delay approached with his sword. In the final act, Fu Delay cursed him and screamed die, slashing out Muki's neck. Muki's cries of pain were drowned in the tent, and Cherry witnessed the horrifying scene as blood splashed in front of her and stained the tent. Cherry called out to Fu Delay in distress while looking at him with full blood. Fu Delay responded by calling her little Cherry, to which Cherry responded in agony. Fu Delay advised Cherry to hide for now, believing that the outside might have heard the noise. He told Cherry to take his headband and find Kai Mei who had promised to send her away. As the tears fell from her eyes, Cherry expressed her concern for Fu Delay. As he wiped the tears from Cherry's face, he explained to her that the man he had killed belonged to the 9th Prince's infantry battalion and they wouldn't just let him go. He consoled Cherry by gently resting his forehead against hers. Cherry, still crying, asked if they couldn't leave together. In response, Fu Delay regretfully declined, emphasizing that she must go to his brother for safety. Despite Cherry's pleas, asking him to not leave her, Fu Delay assured her that as a prince, he would survive and asked her not to cry, urging her to hide well. Cherry continued to address him as master. However, Fu Delay exited his tent, and the sight of him covered in blood alarmed the concerned men. One man questioned why the prince was covered in blood, while another speculated if there were an assassin. Another person inquired about the noise. Curiosity spread among the onlookers, drawing more attention. 
Fu Delay responded with defiance, stating that he was just killed a pervert and questioning the fuss. One onlooker's expression appeared shocked. Another onlooker noticed a lifeless body on the ground. Realization was dawned on them as they recognized the deceased man as Boss Muki. Fu Delay affirmed that he was responsible for Muki's death, citing Muki's failure to obey the law. A man raised concerns, pointing out that Muki was an important general in the army. Another interjected, questioning Fu Delay's right to punish Mu Qi, especially considering his affiliation with the Ninth Prince. Some stated the rules about killing comrades and following military orders. Tensions escalated as some of the men demanded Fu Delay's arrest, brandishing their spears and gesturing towards him. At the watchtower in Ring Camp, Jin Wendao and Kai Mei were talking above and inquiring about Kai Mei's well-being with a concerned tone, wondering if he felt well and if he was ready to join him in command. Kai Mei replied in a weary voice, assuring Jin Wendao that it was nothing serious and he just needed some sleep and he'd be fine. Jin Wendao repeated what Kai Mei said is nothing serious, and he questioned him if he could go into battle. Seeking further details, Kai Mei asked if Jin Wendao meant to attack the city. Jin Wendao explained that if the other side didn't surrender, he might have no other choice but to attack. Voicing his doubts, Kai Mei expressed concern about how sure Jin Wendao was that he could be with his troops when the other side was not easy to deal with. While sipping his tea, Jin Wendao questioned whether Kai Mei's soldiers were not going to fight, hinting at his true motive in seeking his help to save Fu Delay. He then questioned Kai Mei's reasons for wanting to save him. Kai Mei cited Fu Delay's status, emphasizing his relationship as their father's son. Jin Wendao seemed dismissive, mentioning that their father had many sons and daughters and that he couldn't remember this bastard's son. With urgency, Jin Wendao highlighted the significance of the infantry battalion, its elite unit in their army, with numerous battle achievements, and Mu Qi was highly reputable among them. He explained that once Mu Qi died, it would be a group without a leader, no killing would be enough to calm the soldiers' anger. Offering imperial tea, Jin Wendao encouraged Kai Mei to try it, however, Kai Mei seriously looked at him, but Jin Wendao noted that Kai Mei needn't drink it if he wasn't used to it. Jin Wendao's expression was serious as he explained the futility of seeking his help. He emphasized the need to appease the infantry battalion in the camp and find a scapegoat to push the blame. He also noted the absence of an available general for tomorrow's attack. Kai Mei remained resolute, expressing his desire to be the vanguard of the battle for the lead of the infantry battalion, causing Jin Wendao to surprisingly react. Jin Wendao raised doubts about Kai Mei's decision highlighting the high casualty ratio within the infantry battalion and Kai Mei's current inability to command them. But Kai Mei was determined and insisted on asking Jin Wendao for information about the timing of their attack on the city. Jin Wendao revealed their plan to attack the city the next day at midnight. After their conversation with Kai Mei, his men approached Jin Wendao and asked him if Mu Qi's death was something they couldn't just let go of. Jin Wendao chuckled, acknowledging his men's worrying about tomorrow's attack on the city and implying that swords don't have eyes. With an eerie smirk, Jin Wendao assured his men that they would have the opportunity to seek revenge. During that time, within the ring camp, Kai Mei went to Fu Delay's tent, who had been tied up in a crucified-like position as punishment for his actions. Kai Mei muttered, silly younger brother. Kai Mei expressed concern, questioning if it was worth it for that dirty woman. Fu Delay sought affirmation, asking if he was wrong. Kai Mei reassured him, stating that he wasn't wrong. Kai Mei spoke of the harsh realities of the world, where those without power had to watch as everything was taken away from them. He described how loved ones could be killed, relatives harmed, and the humiliation of wives and children, all within the human world. Fu Delay inquired about Little Cherry, expressing concern for her well-being. Kai Mei paused for a moment before delivering the devastating news. He then informed Fu Delay that she was dead. At that moment, Fu Delay's soul felt like it had been stabbed by a spear. His desperation led him to attempt to break free from his restraints, the sound of handcuffs clicking. Fu Delay cried out in frustration, demanding to know why, emphasizing the promises that had been made to him. Kai Mei explained the grim situation, emphasizing that someone had to take the blame for the situation, and it had to be either Fu Delay or Cherry. He disclosed that Cherry had willingly accepted all the blame, falsely confessing to killing the general to save Fu Delay. Kai Mei revealed that Cherry had taken the entire blame upon herself, even though it was just some poorly made lies, but he had no intention of saving her. He confessed to lacking a scapegoat and didn't bother to find one. As a result, she had been executed by court-martial. With resolve, Kai Mei offered advice, telling Fu Delay that as a military leader with great merit, no one would be able to bother him. As Kai Mei slowly walked away, 
He encouraged Fu Delay to stay safe and promised him once they were done capturing the city, they would go back to the tribe to gather an elite warrior. Kai Mei glanced back at Fu Delay and declared that they would then compete with others to rule the world. Meanwhile, Fu Delay was hunched over, tears streaming down his face, as he could only cry in pain while remembering Cherry's face. Fu Delay lamented over the words he spoke, those loud, bold, and childish words, realizing that he could not protect anything, that he only was locked there like a dead dog. As the tears streamed down his face, he acknowledged his weakness. The next day morning, the ring launched an all-out attack. The ring armies were currently positioned, and Xiao Yu was in front while he was bound on the cart. Exhausted, Xiao Yu uttered his plea to kill him repeatedly. On the high wall in Toad Village, Fei Hu clenched his jaw, and Fei Bao was beside him while looking at ring armies. A warrior reported to Jin Wendao that they were already within range of the Toad Village archers, but Jin Wendao ordered them to keep advancing. The distance between the Ring Tribe and Toad Village steadily decreased from 700 paces to 500, then to 300, as the gate of Toad Village slowly creaked open and revealed Cheng Dalei riding on a horse while wearing a straw cape and his axe on his back. The warrior standing next to Jin Wendao wondered why there was only one person and questioned what Cheng Dalei would do, and suspected that opening the gate meant they were surrendering or preparing to fight to the bitter end. Cheng Dalei continued to advance, facing everyone in the Ring Tribe. In a weakened state, Xiao Yu called out to Cheng Dale, his face and body bearing the marks of numerous scars. Stuttering, Xiao Yu expressed mixed emotions, suggesting that Cheng Dale shouldn't have come but also thanked him with a faint smile crossing his lips. Those who hold fire for the world must not freeze to death in the snowstorm. In front of Toad Village, Jin Wendao noticed Cheng Dale acting a bit strangely, and asked his armies who wanted to kill him. Meng Zian volunteered to fight Cheng Dale. Confident that he knew the abilities of Cheng Dale were almost trash. With a grim smile forming on Meng Zian's face, he rushed towards Cheng Dale, insulting him. Cheng Dale swiftly drew his swords and struck Meng Zian down with a single powerful slash, while he cursed him to die. Meng Zian thought to himself that there were such fast swords in the world, and he also noticed that Cheng Dale was giving off a strong killing intent. In a one on one battle, Meng Zian was defeated, his body lay on the ground, covered in his own blood. Cheng Dale's swords dripped with blood, leaving the ring tribe in fear. Jin Wendao questioned Cheng Dale's unusual attire, to which Cheng Dale responded that he wore it because it was going to rain, causing Jin Wendao to question him. Cheng Dale claimed that his master was the South Pole Immortal, Marshal Tanpeng was his senior, and Taibai Golden Star was his sword brother. He then threatened to use Immortal Kai to consume their souls. But the ring armies responded with disbelief and mockery. Some of them shouted mockingly, while others taunted Cheng Dale, questioning his claim to immortality. Laughter erupted among the armies, with some suggesting that Cheng Dale was senselessly scared, as Cheng Dale remained resolute and warned them that he would subject them to half a day of trial and hardship. Jin Wendao joined in the laughter, finding the situation highly amusing. He commented on Cheng Dale's fantasy of mastering an immortal technique, leading to more laughter and agreement from the ring armies. As Cheng Dale stood still, he opened his arms, he said that the wind was coming. The system slightly opened her eyes when suddenly the leaves in the trees began to rustle, and the flags from the armies were fluttering in the wind. The system and Cheng Dale performed synchronized actions. They both said the ritual, gathered the clouds, and then thunder. Suddenly, a thunderous rumble filled the air as lightning struck down, startling not only Jin Wendao, but also his people behind him. They were all in shock. Continuing with their coordinated movements, Cheng Dale looked up and sighed with relief that it finally came. Suddenly, rain began to pour, and Jin Wendao, caught off guard, was drenched as rainwater streamed down his face, causing him to nearly lose his balance on his horse. While the Ring Tribe armies were in a state of hysteria, they repeatedly shouted that it was raining. Jin Wendao expressed his astonishment at Cheng Dale's extraordinary abilities, pondering if he might be immortal, and questioned whether Cheng Dale, as a disciple of an immortal, could truly summon wind and rain. The Ring armies were in awe, confirming that Marshal Tanpeng was indeed Cheng Dale's brother and that his brother had sent down heavy rain to save him. Then the armies began chanting that Cheng Dale was immortal. Cheng Dale continued to intimidate them, addressing them as mere mortals, and warning them not to offend the power of heaven. He then advanced aggressively toward the Ring tribe while threatening them, saying that they should fear heaven's punishment, and declared to kill them. The Ring tribe warriors were so confused that they didn't react. Cheng Dale took the opportunity to save Xiao Yu, slicing through the ropes that had bound him. Jin Wendao dismissed Cheng Dale's abilities as tricks and urged his men not to be afraid, ordering them to kill Cheng Dale. 
Cheng Dale, holding Xiao Yu, hastily retreated to their village, with Ring tribe members in pursuit, accusing him of being a swindler. Cheng Dale called for Xi Long's whereabouts, and Xi Long responded, indicating his arrival with Kin Man. He shouted to cover Cheng Dale. However, Jin Wendao commanded his people to charge and break through the city. The Ring tribe armies screamed kill as they charged Cheng Dale. The dragon gave the order that the rain spread over the sky and the earth. The impulses were like the Milky Way pouring into the trench, and the velocity was like the cloud flowing through the sea gate. The dragon took this opportunity to help and lifted the Yangtze River to look down. All the ring men were rushing toward Toad Village, ready to kill them all. In the heavy rain, the arrows lost their purpose. Xi Long, Kin Man, and Zhang Fei were trying to hold the ring tribe at the gate, slashing at the approaching ring armies. While fighting, Xi Long urged his comrades to retreat, ensuring that Cheng Dale had retreated safely. Zhang Fei and Kin Man acknowledged his command. As the ring armies continued to advance, Jin Wendao ordered Kai Mei to lead their troops and break through the city. Kai Mei rallied the infantry troops, saying long live children of eternal nature. He then urged them to break through the city with him. The ring armies roared in response as they went inside the toad village. As the saying goes, if you defend for a long time you'll lose, there's no reason why you can't break it. Cheng Dale called for everyone to take their positions and get ready. A person hurriedly instructed others to bring out the stuff. Today, for the first time, the gates of the Toad Village were breached. As the Ring armies were inside the Toad Village, others wondered if it was an urn city, while some questioned why the urn city was located inside. Jin Wendao, who was still outside of the Toad Village, commanded his armies, indicating two ways for them to proceed. Teams 2 and 3 were given specific orders to open passages on the left and right sides of the city. In response, the ring armies charged forward, roaring as they advanced and infiltrated the Toad Village. At the high wall in Toad Village, the warriors warned the others by telling everybody to be careful that rings were coming while some were defending the intersection. However, on the opposite side, the ring armies with shields were ordered to break the lines of defense. In the subsequent set, other ring armies were commanded to break through, with a siege team attempting to break down the gates of the Urn City. Jin Wendao motivated his troops by promising rewards to the first ones to break through the city, causing ring armies to charge forward, and their roars echoed inside Urn City as they breached it. People poured into the gates, and their numbers continued to grow, with more and more people gathering. Amidst the chaos among the ring armies, calls were made to make way for the siege hammer. Some urged their comrades to charge forward, while others questioned why the walls couldn't be breached. As the rain poured heavily, Cheng Dale stood atop the wall while watching the ring armies trying to get inside the village. He then said that this site was the so-called inviting them into the urn city. He then called the attention of the ring armies, calling them ring tribe scum, berating them for daring to offend the might of heaven, and claimed to perform a thunder summoning technique. Then, Kin Man threw the box of fire, causing a massive explosion. Suddenly, the ring armies were left in fear. Some believed Cheng Dale could summon lightning, while others believed that he was the reincarnation of an immortal. Due to Cheng Dale's cleverness, the fear points increased rapidly. Kai Mei, however, recognized the use of gunpowder and attempted to reassure the ring armies that Cheng Dale was merely playing tricks. In a different setting, Cheng Dale's group quietly moves the explosive bombs out of the warehouse, telling others to take care not to let the gunpowder get wet from the rain. They hurriedly lit the fire and dropped each of the bombs below. The ring armies got hit by the bombs, and some were thrown away. Amidst the chaos, some ring armies believed it was divine retribution, stating that they had angered the immortal. The fear points continued to increase significantly. In another setting, a warrior in Toad Village wonders why explosive gunpowder was still there, recalling that this place should have been emptied. Others urged him to hurry, not to waste any time. Cheng Dale exchanged gunpowder, purchasing it from the system in this alternate setting. The system chuckles and informs him that the gunpowder has been processed for him and is ready to use, even waterproofed. In the midst of war, Kai Mei, consumed by anger, still commands his troops to charge, emphasizing that breaking the city is their only chance of survival. He urged them to kill. Internally, Kai Mei wondered how the toad gunpowder could still work in the rain. Suddenly, he was struck by an explosion, causing him to fall on his horse. Concerned ring armies shouted for him to run away others saying that he must retreat, calling Cheng Dale immortal. Kai Mei cursed in his thought, wondering why the Toad had so much gunpowder. He realized that his armies were frightened and had begun to ignore his commands. All of the Ring Army's fighting spirit is broken as they frantically run away from the explosion. Some even stumbled in their haste. However, Kai Mei stood still while looking above the wall, surrounded by his panicking army. 
While the rain was dripping on his face, Kaime reflected on the situation. As he thought that he was going to win, he was hit head on. With conviction, he addressed Cheng Dale's urn city as a pot that would cook everyone to death. His words resonated during the explosive chaos that surrounded them. Outside Toad Village, Jin Wendao commanded his army to charge, threatening those who stepped back with beheading. If the information of the battlefield was drowned in endless rainstorms and explosions, some ring armies continued to charge, but they found the gate blocked by the corpses of their comrades. And the information couldn't be conveyed, more people jumped into the pot. The gates were crowded with ringers who wanted to escape this infernal hell. Explosions rang out behind them, and the corpses and rocks were splashing everywhere. More people outside were pushed in, blocking the gates and cutting off the way out. Then, everyone became enemies. Back inside the urn city of Toad Village, the ring armies became hostile toward each other. Some ringers were screaming, telling others to not block the way. However, Fu Delay was pressed against the wall while looking at his companions. He thought that they were becoming crazy as they were killing each other. As he witnessed the violence and fear, he could hear the sounds of explosions and fighting, and he found himself surrounded by blood. He then tightly gripped his sword. Fu Delay couldn't help but think this was hell. In the midst of his thoughts, a ring army spotted him, accompanied by another ring army. They rushed to attack Fu Delay, seeking revenge for Mu Qi's life. But Kaime suddenly arrived and killed the two ringers. Overwhelmed, Fu Delay called Kaime's name. Kaime scolded Fu Delay, called him an idiot, and expressed concern for how he had gotten there and was still there. Fu Delay simply addressed him in response. Suddenly, Kaime quickly defended Fu Delay from their comrades who were behind him, and Fu Delay was left stunned by the turn of events. Kaime grabbed Fu Delay and urged him to come with him, emphasizing that the battle was lost, and staying would only lead to death. Together, they ran toward the gate, but many ringers were blocking their way. While the ringers near the gate desperately called others to move aside or expressed that they were doomed, as the gate was blocked by corpses and could not get out. As Kaime approached, he went on a rampage, slaughtering the ringers to clear their path for their escape. He shouted at them to get away. The ringers' screams filled the air as they were tossed aside. Walking on a path paved with corpses, paddled through a river of blood. The sword in the hand was the oar that cut the flow of blood. This was a path from the Yellow Springs to the human world. The city gate was already a sea of corpses and blood. From inside the city to outside the city, every direction led to the mountains of human corpses. Fu Delay attempted to speak to his brother, but Kaime frustratingly silenced Fu Delay and instructed him to follow. Kaime told him that he would get Fu Delay out of there. He then carried Fu Delay on his shoulder and made his way through the mountain of corpses and managed to throw Fu Delay outside the gate. Struggling to stand, Fu Delay called Kaime and urged him to come quickly, but within moments, explosive gunpowder hit Kaime and Fu Delay saw it as he screamed brother in terror. As his blood spread everywhere, Kaime's body was among the piled up corpses, and he coughed drops of blood. While Fu Delay attempted to pull Kaime from the mound of corpses, he had used all his strength to pull Kaime out. But he didn't have much strength, even with all his strength he couldn't do anything. Powerless, what an annoying word. And sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change anything, even if you've already given it your all. Overwhelmed by grief, Fu Delay cried bitterly while attempting to help Kaime. Kaime, in a weakened state, consoled Fu Delay, patting his head and urging him to grow up quickly and not be a loser in the future. He smiled faintly and repeatedly said to Fu Delay to grow up fast as he tried to wipe away Fu Delay's tears. As Kaime faded away from this world, Fu Delay was left alone outside the city, which led to the human world. There was no one left to stand beside him, to take his hand and clear the way for him. He had to walk the following path alone. Meanwhile, Jin Wendao angrily commanded his troops to kill those who were attempting to retreat. As the saying went, the defeat of an army was like a mountain whose fall could in no way be stopped by the strength of a single person. The battlefield was constantly changing, and the winner or loser could change at any time. The barbarians became a cauldron, and that cauldron shook and crumpled. Half of Jin Wendao's troops melted away. After that, the cleaning of corpses alone took Cheng Dalei 10 days. The siege of King New Mountain was only a small battlefield for the invasion of the rings. And on the border with the empire, hundreds of tribes of the ring joined together in a mega alliance and declared war on the empire on all fronts. All the princes of the ring tribe led their own armies and invaded by force. In Pingju City, the defenders encountered the rings and collapsed at the first encounter, fleeing for their lives, while the city lord disappeared without a trace. The city lord of Pingju refused to defend the city, stating that only stupid people would try to defend it. On the northwestern edge, a renowned general struggled to survive and looked eastward, hoping for provisions to arrive. 
In the capital city, someone expressed skepticism about General Lin potentially taking control of the imperial court and decided to delay military food supplies to him. In another location, there were also scholars who had given up writing to join the army. There were also leaders who had taken refuge on the south side of the river. In a water village in the south of the river, a team of merchants rushed to the capital with great haste. On the same street, another merchant sold his family's possessions in exchange for 100,000 quintals of rice to supply the army in the north. In the northwest lands, Zingzai, the sixth prince of the kingdom, stood by a city, urging its inhabitants to resist the rings with him as he raised his seal above. There was never a shortage of profit-driven villains in this country, and there was no shortage of heroes who swam against the tide. Even more so, the ordinary people were tired of running away and trying to survive. That year, the rings came like a flood, and the borders of the empire were on fire. While in King Niu Mountain, on the other hand, it was like a puddle basin. When the water-like stream of soldiers flowed through it, it could not go any further. And the more they accumulated, the greater the accumulation was. At the high wall in Taud village, Shenji alerted Cheng Dale to check the ring's camp, pointing out that there were more people in the ring camp. Shenji expressed astonishment, noting that this time there were many people, at least 5,000, as he gestured toward the ring's camp direction. Cheng Dale responded with a hint of worry, remarking that Shenji seemed overly excited about people coming from the opponent's side. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale couldn't understand why the ring's camp was so angry toward him. He reflected on the fact that new people continued to join the ring's camp every day, estimating that there were probably more than 100,000 ring members now, and lamented the loss of their deployed spies, making it impossible to assess the enemy's situation accurately. Cheng Dale explained that with only 2,000 fighters against 100,000, the probability of holding their position was close to zero unless they were supplied with a truckload of Cat 98K. Curious, Shenji asked for clarification about the Cat 98K, and Cheng Dale explained it as a powerful murder weapon, which Shenji understood. Shenji pondered that the rings might be hostile as they killed their people, but Cheng Dale believes most wars are driven by profit. Then, with a hint of humor, he seriously considered the possibility that they might be jealous of his good looks, to which Shenji reacted with silence clearly not sharing Cheng Dale's sense of humor. Continuing to boost himself, Cheng Dale sighed as he blamed himself, remarking on the challenges faced by beautiful people. Growing impatient, Shenji called Cheng Dale's attention and asked him if anyone had ever told him that he had a bigger mouth than their city walls. Cheng Dale responded with a mischievous giggle. At the big tent of the rings, a man slammed his hand on the table in frustration, expressing his desire to be able to take over the capital. He blamed his abrupt transfer on the other prince for having a bad job. This man himself was the sixth prince, Lei Nu. Another prince interrupted, introducing as the eighth prince named Lai Mu, shared his own experience of being transferred despite his successful conquests with his troops. He bragged that he had taken five cities in a row and collected a bundle of city lord seals. Then another prince reacted, which was the fifth prince named Ka Temen. He boasted about killing numerous imperial generals and collecting their heads and even suggested bringing their severed heads as proof of his accomplishments. Lei Nu belittled Ka Temen's act of killing a few generals, claiming it was nothing significant. He challenged the other princes to see who was truly powerful by proposing the idea of beheading the emperor's head. Temen countered Lei Nu's challenge with his own proposal for a competition, suggesting horseback riding or archery. Lei Nu responded by daring Temen to draw his sword and threatening to slit his mouth. Temen fired back, vowing to feed Lei Nu to the pigs in return. In the midst of their heated exchange, Jin Wendao observed the quarrel among the princes with a sense of depression. He found their bickering annoying and covered his ears in irritation. Jin Wendao's thoughts reflected on his own situation, acknowledging that Kaime was dead and he had lost the battle. He also lost hope of winning the race for the throne as he no longer mattered to it. Suddenly, another prince named Jiabu calmed the argument between the other princes. He suggested that they should stop bickering and work together to achieve their father's goals. Jiabu then inquired if they had any idea on how to capture Toad Village. The room fell into silence in response to Prince Jiabu's question. To his surprise at the lack of response, he questioned whether it wasn't as easy to capture. Temen then spoke up, mentioning that Jin Wendao had once fought against Toad Village, despite being carried back. He emphasized that they should take advantage of Jin Wendao's experience. Lei Nu expressed his concerns about Cheng Dale, describing him as an extremely cunning person. He also mentioned rumors about Cheng Dale's ability to summon thunder and how this thunder had scared Jin Wendao's men leading to their loss. Jin Wendao dismissed the idea of lightning spells, asserting that it was actually gunpowder. 
Jia Bu then stated that perhaps Jin Wendao was only focused on attacking the front gate, raising the question of whether they should consider attacking the cliffs on either side. But Jin Wendao explained that the cliffs were over 100 feet high and not suitable for climbing, and his soldiers were not good at climbing over a wall. Jin Wendao argued that crossing the cliffs was not feasible, even for hundreds of people, and it would likely lead to death. He suggested that their only option now was to attack Toad Village with force. Jia Bu agreed, confident that their overwhelming numbers would ensure victory without the need for tricks. With the termination, Jia Bu suggested fighting it out by slamming his hand on the table. Back in Toad Village, inside Toad Village, Cheng Dalei and Shenji were talking. Shenji pointed out the fertile soil and mentioned that it was the time of year to plant the seeds for a good life only through self-cultivation. However, Cheng Dalei expressed his concerns about the Ring tribe's invasion, which had disrupted their peaceful way of life and made it difficult to farm or even defend the village for much longer. Acknowledging the 100,000 armies of the Ring, Cheng Dalei mentioned the matter of time before the city collapsed. They had to make early preparations to survive. Shenji inquired if he had a plan to which Cheng Dale responded that they couldn't hold out for much longer and that he felt frustrated about the situation. Shenji sought questions about their escape route, mentioning that besides the city gate, there were no other mountain roads. Cheng Dale explained, stating that they didn't need to worry about breaking out through the city gate. Instead, they planned to dig a mountain path in the valley, providing them with an escape route. They would fight if they could win and retreat if they could not. Suddenly, their conversation was abruptly interrupted by the sound of their drums, alerting them that the ringers were attacking. Shenji commented that the ringer was advancing toward them again. Cheng Dalei ordered everyone to go on top of the wall. As they hurriedly positioned themselves, Shenji once again asked Cheng Dalei if they could hold off the ringers, but he only replied that they should wait and watch. A hundred thousand ringers were ready for war, which was revealed as the mist slowly cleared. A warrior villager urged everyone to get ready. The villagers used drums to signal readiness. With a roaring command, Jiabu led his army to attack, launching trebuchets and rocks toward Toad Village while other ringers attacked below. While in Toad Village, Zhu Yu ordered the use of the latest steel pan bombs, intending to give the ringers a taste of it. Steel pan was made by blacksmith Zhu Yu, the outer layer was made of iron and the inner part was filled with gunpowder, iron nails, and stones. The ringers screamed in pain as they were struck by the impact of the bombs, and Cheng Dalei gained fear points rapidly due to their latest weapon. Amidst the chaos and fear that engulfed the ringers, Cheng Dalei relentlessly exchanged gunpowder with the system. The system expressed its gratitude for his support as she showed a smile. In front of the city gate of Toad Village, there was a triangular open space that could not accommodate 100,000 soldiers but at most a few thousand people in each attack. After the indiscriminate bombardment, this open space became a meat grinder for slaughter. When the city walls finally began to tatter, the rings were the first to endure heavy losses. After leaving behind several thousand corpses, they decided to retreat. In the ringer's camp, all the princes were stagnant as they huddled, weighed down by their losses. With a hint of amusement, Jin Wendao said to himself that now his brothers knew the powers of Toad Village while maintaining a nonchalant expression. He added that his brother did not underestimate him and laughed at him. Jia Bu then broke the silence as he asked about the gunpowder supply in Toad Village, wondering as he had never seen a shortage of it, questioning the possibility that the mountain might have been full of gunpowder, expressing his concerns that the number of victims would have been high if they continued to fight. He then asked his brothers for advice. Lei Nu suggested an alternative strategy if the direct attack seemed impossible. He proposed sending troops to infiltrate the village from the top and break through them from the inside. However, Jia Bu opposed Lei Nu's plan, pointing out that the mountaintop was too steep and sending a small group of troops would likely have resulted in certain death. Mu suggested a plan to throw a few corpses into the valley river to infect them with the plague, causing the city to collapse on its own. Disagreeing with Mu's plan, Temin mentioned that they were still in the slipstream and the plague could have spread to them. He then voiced his idea to corner the Toad Village for half a year until they ran out of food, causing the city to collapse naturally. Mu expressed concerns about the time constraints and the uncertainty of the city's survival. He worried that their forces would have run out of food before them. Another suggestion was added, suggesting the use of fire and asking that they attack with fire. Jia Bu expressed concerns about using fire attacks due to the uncertainty surrounding Toad Village's gunpowder supplies. Frustrated with their indecision, Jin Wendao questioned the necessity of fighting Toad Village. Mu explained that Mount King Mu was a strategic place, as troops from the Empire could have used it to launch attacks and defend against them easily. 
He also highlighted the need to guard against potential sneak attacks from King New Mountain as they advanced south. However, Jin Wendao argued that Toad Village had a small fighting strength of one or two thousand people, emphasizing that they couldn't have played a big role. Whether they defended themselves or faced sneak attacks from behind, they would have eventually had to leave the city and fight directly, reassuring his brother that there was nothing to worry about. Jia Bu reminded Jin Wendao about their father's instructions to retrieve something from King New Mountain, emphasizing the importance of the task. In a rude response, Jin Wendao stated that the thing from King New Mountain couldn't have grown legs and run away. Highlighting the current issue at hand, Jin Wendao expressed his concern about the decreasing morale of their troops due to Cheng Dale's gunpowder and the spreading of rumors. Jin Wendao proposed a strategic shift, suggesting that they should head south and take over other cities to break the spirit of those who wanted to send troops to support King New Mountain. He believed this would help boost the morale of their soldiers and prepare them for future battles. He laid out his plan to conquer other cities first before focusing their efforts on Toad Village. He expressed a desire to capture Cheng Dale and display his head on a flagpole. Jin Wendao desired to show the world that the warriors of the rings were unrivaled in the world. With shock on their faces, the princes seemed to find Jin Wendao's plan realistic. Jia Bu acknowledged Jin Wendao's strategy and decided that they would move their forces out of the camp the following day and head south. Meanwhile, a spy observing Toad Village from afar noticed that the rings had retreated. He urgently instructed his companion to relay the message. The spy swiftly spread the news to various cities, including Yuzhu City, T City, Kisha City, and Bijan City. In Bizan City, a person was curious how Toad Village managed to defend themselves for two months, wondering whether Toad Village was too good or the Ring Tribe was too bad. In Kingzhu, a chief named Wang Yufeng pondered the idea that the Rings might not be as powerful today as they were 30 years ago. While in Yuzhu City, Lai Shanyan discussed the situation with Longting. Lai Shanyan reported to Longting that Toad Village had successfully defended itself for two months against the Rings army causing the attackers to suffer heavy losses. Wang Ting expressed his surprise, admitting that he had underestimated them. Lai Shanyan suggested that the rings might be weakened due to the drought and that it could be an opportunity to launch a major attack and potentially destroy the ring. However, Long Ting advised caution, suggesting they observe, as they were dealing with the formidable ring tribe. He believed that the mountain bandits of Toad Village could continue to exhaust them, to which Lai Shanyan agreed. Before they could continue, a soldier rushed in with an urgent report, stating that something bad had happened. Meanwhile, in Tiani City, Bo Shan planned to return to Fallen Leaf City, and he was in a hurry, loading everything onto a cart. The man suggested that he should stay longer, but Bo Shan declined the offer, explaining that he couldn't stay anymore. A sense of frustration, Bo Shan cursed the man in his thoughts, wearing a fake smile outside as he realized that staying longer there would suck all of his assets. He decided to return to Fallen Leaf City and send supplies and soldiers to King New Mountain, allowing him to relax in peace. In this exchange, the man expressed a willingness to accompany Bo Shan to the door and playfully mentioned their liking for a sword. Bo Shan initially responded with an apologetic and somewhat embarrassed tone, admitting he had lost the sword a long time ago. The man seemed disappointed upon hearing that the sword was lost, expressing pity. Suddenly, a soldier delivered news to Bo Shan that caused Bo Shan to sweat and display a worried expression, indicating that the news was unsettling. With a ridiculed expression, Bo Shan called the man and stopped them from leaving, shouting that the swords had been found. Back in Toad Village, a warrior informed Cheng Dale that the ringers were retreating, and the villagers expressed surprise at the sudden retreat. However, Cheng Dale remained cautious and thoughtfully commented that he expected the ringers to stay indefinitely. Fei Hu asked if they could retreat now, and Cheng Dale responded by noting that the ringers were leaving some of their forces behind to block their escape route. Fei Hu told Cheng Dale that the ringers were heading south. Cheng Dale suspected that the rings were preparing to attack Yuzhu before returning to clean them up. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale realized that the ringers' departure could bring suffering to the people of Yuzhu, leaving a trail of corpses everywhere. Cheng Dale told everyone that it was their chance to take a break and urged everyone to get ready. 80,000 ringers moved south to attack Fallen Leaf City first. The Fallen Leaf City was unguarded, and it was destroyed within one day. First, they attacked the city of Kisha, they stormed the city with refugees, destroyed the city, and slaughtered everyone. T City was then attacked, T City held fast to its defenses. 20,000 ringers trapped the city, declaring that those who surrendered would be spared, and if they did not surrender, the city would be destroyed. The remaining 60,000 people attacked Yuzhu City. 
Yang Longting personally took command on the battlefield and fought together with the soldiers, which significantly boosted their morale. When the ring saw that Yuzhu City was a hard bone to chew, they turned their attention towards Bijan City. The soldiers of Bijan City fought hard to the death, and it stood unconquered for a long time. At that time, the chief of King Zhu, Wang Yufeng, led a 50,000-man army to Yuzhu to drive out the barbarians and save the people. In the plains outside the city, he met the rings and fought a bloody battle. The Iron Cavalry of the Rings scattered Wang Gufeng's army in a few rounds, killing and wounding countless people. He was stuck in the Valley of the Long Wind with 10,000 remnants of his troops. The Ring tribe surrounded them but did not kill them. Several of Wang Gufeng's sons led a large army to help, but against the Iron Horsemen of the Ring tribe, they could do nothing. The classic tactic of surrounding the place and slowing down the enemies ended up killing at least 100,000 King Zhu soldiers. He risked his life to break out of the encirclement and fled back to King Zhu with remnants of his army. At this point, the trapped Tea City knew it was no match for them. The city lord went out to surrender and only begged the Ring tribe not to treat the people in the city too badly. The Ring stormed the city and slaughtered everyone. The 80,000-strong army of the Ring ranged for a month in the Yuzhu area, and the population of Yuzhu which was three of five million, were reduced by half. People lived in great misery and there were corpses everywhere. At the back of Toad Village, Cheng Dale discussed the possibility of digging a tunnel in Toad Village with Shenji. But Shenji found that the rocks were too solid, suggesting the use of gunpowder. Cheng Dale opposed the idea of using gunpowder as the Ring tribe still had their eyes on them and could not take risks. Then he suggested that if they couldn't dig a path on the mountain, he thought about the possibility of going through the mountain asking them if anyone on his people could climb. In response, Shenji stated that people in the mountains gathered medicine and sometimes climbed more dangerous places than that. Cheng Dale instructed them to send a few expert climbers to attempt the ascent and throw ropes down to create a passage through the mountain. He approached it with the idea that whoever they were, they would take care of it. Later on, some of the men of Cheng Dale immediately started to climb. Some men successfully climbed up to the mountain. After several days, several rope ladders were successfully built, allowing all the men to ascend and see their village below. Fei Hu assisted Cheng Dale after they climbed to the top of the mountain and casually addressed Cheng Dale while Cheng Dale told him that they would head over there. As the group was on top of the mountain, they looked towards their village, and Cheng Dale was silent for a bit as he gazed through it. Suddenly, Cheng Dale cursed in frustration, which caused Fei Hu to ask him about it. Cheng Dale responded that he now understood why the Ring tribe was so eager to haunt him. He then took a look back in the past to where the treasure map that he got from Huang Sanyuan was, and exclaimed that the terrain inside was exactly the same as the one in front of him. He added that the Ring tribe plundered the empire 30 years ago. Cheng Dale could not imagine how much gold, silver, and jewelry that the Ring tribe robbed, as the remaining treasures were hidden in their valley. He could even confirm the locations directly through his map. Acknowledging the situation, he made the decision that there was no time to waste to take the treasure out. And then on, Cheng Dale ordered Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei Bao to take 500 of their warriors and escort the old, weak, women, and children from the village within three days, leading them south to a safer location, which Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei acknowledged his order. Liu Bei sighed that every place outside the mountain was also being watched by the Ring tribe, making it difficult to leave. Cheng Dale answered that they must only move slowly in groups and at night. Liu Bei was doubtful about the plan because it was a race against time and the idea was to walk slowly. Cheng Dale reassured that there would be enough time and after a short pause he called Guan Yu. He ordered Guan Yu to take 500 of their warriors to do something. But before he continued his word Liu Bei interfered again, doubting Cheng Dale's words, stating that their village would be left with less than a thousand of their warriors and worried if they could still defend the village. Cheng Dale promised that he would find a way to stall them and buy time for everyone. When Liu Bei sighed again, Cheng Dale could not control anymore and was so irritated that he threatened to beat him up to a pulp. Liu Bei was not pleased as he gazed at Cheng Dale in silence. He then looked in another direction as he thought about the 100,000 ring warriors and worried about how Cheng Dale held them alone. Soon after, a messenger reported that 100,000 ring warriors had assembled outside their village, ready to attack. Worried, Fei Hu raised out his concern and approached Cheng Dale, telling him that the situation was irreversible. He shared an idea to bring as many people as they could. Despite the grim situation, Cheng Dale remained calm, mentioning that they had a retreat plan. He then declared to his companies that he would show who was the boss. The nine families of the Ring tribe were reunited as the Ring tribe's banner covered the sky, 
and their weapons and armor covered the field. After many days of fighting in Yuzhu, the morale of the Ring Army was at its peak. With a roaring voice, Jiabu confidently ordered an attack, emphasizing the invincibility of the Ring's cavalry, which he believes to be unparalleled in the world. After a couple of hours in the Ring's camp tent, Jiabu reflected on the previous battle, describing it as a war of iron and stone. They discussed the successful breach of city gates and boasted about the southerners being defenseless who only ran for their lives like sheep. Jiabu was dismayed about capturing the Jinju and Yuzhu city as they were not broken but considered this as a small setback. Jin Wendao asked if the people of Iron River City were killed as they were still having a fierce fight with their soldiers and still wanted to fight against our cavalry. They taught them how to behave well, reminisced, the time when he was so happy, and he had no time to wipe the blood on his sword as he kept cutting them up. Temin added that no one could compete with their warriors on horseback. They then turned their attention to planning their attack on Toad Village the following day. Expressing his eagerness, Temin wanted to confront Chang Dale, to charge them with their 100,000 soldiers, even putting aside the method they were planning about. Liu boasted that when their army rushed them, Cheng Dale became scared and wet his pants. Lei Nu promised to use the nine methods to torture Cheng Dale once he caught him. With a smirk, Jin Wendao thought that tomorrow would be a bloody battle when they attacked the village. As he was about to continue, someone burst into the meeting, notifying that at the front of the Toad Village, a bonfire and drums were present. He was confused about what they were trying to do. At the Toad Village gate, a large bonfire was set high on the wall, and Cheng Dale stood there wearing his leafy outfit. He chanted a ritual, looking like he knew what he was doing, but in reality, he was just chanting some gibberish words that sounded like nonsensical words like Jilly Gulu and Ababa. The ringers were puzzled about what Cheng Dale was up to. Some were predicting that it was because he could not protect the village anymore and decided to burn himself to death. Jiabu ordered to send some men over there to eavesdrop on the incantation Cheng Dale was chanting. Later, the man came back to report. He stated that they hid at the bottom of the gate and faintly heard him saying words about the boundless end of the world being his love and flowers bloomed at the foot of the kitchen. Lei Nu was moved when he heard the magical melody, immediately concluding that it was indeed an incantation. Jiabu was left speechless as he heard the report. As he listened to the report, Jin Wendao realized that Cheng Dale was praying for the rain. Jiabu seconded the statement from Jin Wendao and acknowledged that Chen Dale had that kind of ability. Jin Wendao was sure and witnessed him doing that incantation before. He was unsure if he could summon it again this time. Jiabu tried to remain vigilant about it and thought that Cheng Dale was only playing tricks on them. He asked the men not to be fooled and to leave a few people to keep an eye on Cheng Dale. Tomorrow morning, the plan to attack the village will remain unchanged, and this time they must break through Toad Village. The next day, right before dawn, Jiabu stated that they were about to face an imminent death, meaning death was near at hand. He added that no matter how many tricks Cheng Dale would play, it would not change anything. Jiabu gathered everyone's attention and alerted them to start moving. As they were about to start the attack, a heavy rain suddenly poured, forcing the attack to withdraw. The rainy season at King New Mountain had started. Back in Toad Village, Liu Jai sobbed about her relationship with Cheng Dale. She thought about him being unable to come back to sleep recently and only ran to Su Ying's place every day. All that while she was packing her stuff up. She thought if she was not good enough, that would make Cheng Dale unhappy. Or was it about her age? She added that she recently asked those sisters who were older than her. Liu Jai learned a lot from them, stating that she was still in the developing phase. She thought that every step was very important and she was still young compared to Sister Yin. She whispered to herself to be brave as she still had room for growing up. She thought that if she had known earlier, she would let Ma teach her the thing first, and she would have been able to take the initiative. But now she didn't have the chance. Liu Jai snapped back to reality and asked herself what she was thinking about. She was still thinking about fighting for favor at this crucial moment of the war. She concluded that it would be much better to wait until the war was over and better think in a hurry and followed the retreating army. Meanwhile, Su Ying and Cheng Dale enjoyed each other's company amidst the rain. Su Ying asked Cheng Dale if he could really summon thunder and rain. She also asked if there were really immortals in the world. Cheng Dale answered that there might be one, and he knew her pretty well. Su Ying was curious what immortals looked like as she wanted to see one. Cheng Dale replied that there would be a chance in the future, and now they should enjoy themselves first. Su Ying told him to stop as the rain was going to stop and Xiaoda would hear it. Suddenly, the system beeped as Cheng Dale received many days of wind and rain. As the rainstorm continued, Cheng Dale received rewards from the system, while Cheng Dale responded to Su Ying that the rain wouldn't stop so soon. 
the system itself hovered above. As she controlled the weather, surrounded by lightning and smoke above, she looked below him. In the ring camp, chaos ensued as soldiers tried to manage the flooding caused by the heavy rain. One of them asked if they had finished digging, while the other's ringer shouted for help as the tent collapsed. Inside the prince's tent, Jiabu expressed concern about the continuous rain and its impact on the soldiers who would get bedsores. Lei Nu suggested ordering the troops to attack in the rain, but Mu opposed the idea, recounting a past experience where fighting in the rain proved ineffective. Mu described the difficulties they faced, including arrows falling short, horses struggling, and siege weapons failing due to the heavy rain. He also mentioned that the walls became slippery, making it easy for the enemy to ambush them. Some in the camp believed the rain was the result of the enemy's magic. Jin Wendao remained silent during the discussion, while Temin talked about his childhood as he heard an old man in their tribe say that only magic could defeat magic, they just had to match and break Cheng Dale's sorcery. Jia Bu agreed with the idea and decided to summon the army's witch doctor. It was raining heavily at the campsite of the Ring tribe. Inside the tent, the Grand Prince Jiabu was sitting across the table with a cup in his hand and was saying that the boundless end of the world was his love. It got him thinking that sure enough it might have been a magic spell he unknowingly was affected by. Suddenly a voice emerged telling him the Elder was there and who was invited to come in. The witch doctor Sate Man arrived with an animal skull on his head with a large bead around his neck while holding its staff. Sate Man was told to pay respect to the princes who were taken aback when they saw him. The sixth prince Lei Nu asked if he was the most famous witch doctor of the tribe and said that he was really something else, while the eighth prince Lai Mu was amazed by his aura and that he was a professional. Jia Bu asked to confirm that it was said he could invoke the gods. Sate Man replied that he believed in the everlasting heaven, and all the gods of the grassland accepted his service. He did not know which of the noble princes was sick, so he could pray to the gods to drive away the brutal disease. Jiabu replied that they were not sick, which made Sate Man speechless and wondered why he was needed there if they were not sick. Jiabu asked next if he could summon the wind and Sate Man replied he thought so, he could summon wind and rain. Suddenly, he banged his hand on the table and said good before pointing his finger to Sate Man that his task was breaking the bandit's spell, which shocked him. Sate Man began sweating heavily as he heard about breaking a spell, then thought that the great prince was not well, and would wake up and say he was not sick. Jiabu was grinning while he replied as he expected. He thought that even if the southerners had some magic skills, how could they be compared to the believers of the everlasting heaven? He then stood up, placed his hand on Sate Man's shoulder, and told him that tomorrow the elder would set up an altar to cast a spell to break his sorcery and laughed while Sate Man was silent. Sate Man continued to sweat heavily, thinking that there was a misunderstanding because Jia Bu said he agreed but wondered when he agreed. A few moments later, it was still raining, and a wooden cart was being pushed. It was the wooden altar made for Sate Man being pushed towards the Toad Village. Sate Man stood on top of the wooden altar and thought it was so high. Meanwhile a man was walking on the top of their stone gates with a blazing flame behind him. It was Cheng Dale with a grass raincoat covering him from the rain while dancing to the song of Billie Jean. Despite the heavy rain, Cheng Dale kept grooving aimlessly and moonwalking. This terrified the princes of the Ring tribe, wondering how he managed to walk with his feet while his body was not moving and claimed that it was a magical pace and sharp sorcery. The witch doctor Sate Man couldn't understand Cheng Dale's spell and thought that he was really an expert. He gulped and continued thinking that Cheng Dale would not hit him too hard when they started fighting. Sate Man yelled to get Cheng Dale's attention, then called him an ugly demon and told him not to show off his stupid demonic arts in front of him which caused him to stop dancing and pay attention. Cheng Dale wondered when this fool arrived because he had a hard time remembering how to sing the song and cursed. He forgot the words. Cheng Dale called him a crook, then said he was the Toad Village Immortal who inherited the glorious Immortal Path from the South Pole Immortal himself and how dared he talk about the heavenly law in front of him. Which the Sate Man replied that he was a devotee of eternal nature, the spokesman of the grassland spirit and called him an ugly demon. The witch doctor started thumping his feet and said to watch him break his demonic arts, then yelled to the eternal nature to grant him power, and that he was Sate Man. This terrified Cheng Dale and thought that this was not good. His pace was mysterious and unpredictable. The movement vaguely combined with a certain rhythm. While the witch doctor began dancing, Cheng Dale wondered if this was the legendary Northeast Yongj. Northeast Yongj is the ancestor of square dance in the world to be restrained by the other side if he met the enemy dancing the moonwalk. Cheng Dale removed his grass raincoat and thought that if he wanted to win over the other side, he could only use that move. As the saying goes, never let society shake you down. 
it was useless to have piglets covered in tattoos. Cheng Dale pointed his finger up and yelled to come on music. He started to rap with coordinated dance moves about how he used to be king. Then later he said forget it and gave up his rights and position but they are still fighting and rubbing for power. He used to be young and extremely frivolous, crazy for state power. The sword angrily carved a snow-winged eagle, the generous mountain sword in the skies. The fire continuously burned, and the sea had a thousand waves. These two continued doing their own thing as the rain continued. This amazed the princes of the Ring tribe, wondering if this was a legendary fight between witchcraft and that it was such a pity they couldn't see through the mystery with just ordinary eyes. Sate Man continued thumping his feet yet got distracted and questioned what kind of spell that was because it penetrated through the ear into the heart. Cheng Dale continued his dance and rap about a magic twist. As a result, this got the witch doctor because he felt like it was a whisper of hell. The demon's pace was so powerful that he slipped. It was so slippery that he fell from the wooden altar. He shouted as he fell down to the ground while the ring tribe hurried up and saved the elder. The ring tribe was terrified of the powerful sorcery. They obviously felt very uncomfortable but still wanted to listen to it, and the movement felt like they saw the dance of death. While the ring tribe was scared by his sorcery, Cheng Dale stood tall with his hand in the air and thought if they still wanted to fight him. He did not believe the brainwashing of killing devices of society shaking and shouting weed is sacrifice, he could still survive. Fast forward, it rained heavily for several days while Toad villagers escaped. Liu Jai with a grass raincoat thought of Cheng Dale. Someone asked how many people were still left in the village, then someone replied that they should be all gone in a couple of days. Su Ying was worried and thought of Cheng Dale too. Even the longest rainy season will eventually pass. Even with the help of the gods, the system was extremely exhausted. She looked dreadful and complained she was so tired. Suddenly, she turned small which surprised her. The system panicked and teary-eyed that her last power was also used up. She yelled in her exhaustion. The next day, it was bright and sunny at the Toad Village as the Ring Tribe stood in formation outside its gate. The Grand Prince Jiabu on his horseback told his brothers that day regardless of cost and casualties, they must take down the Toad Village. Cheng Dale asked how many of their people were left since the Ring Tribe was about to attack their city. Tin Man replied that among them, only those who were currently present there were left. Tin Man told Cheng Dale that the time was running out then suggested for him to go ahead, and he would stay with his men to defend the city and buy him time. Cheng Dale replied not to talk nonsense, hurried up, and left, as he would guard the city. This shocked his men and they questioned how he could guard it alone. Cheng Dale answered that it seemed he could only fool them with an empty city. One of the Ring Tribe princes asked his brother when they attacked the city since the army was gathered. Jiabu told him to wait and he sensed that the situation seemed unusual. He then questioned why there was only one person on the walls where Cheng Dale stood tall with a string instrument. The princes of the Ring Tribe wondered if it was Cheng Dale, where were the defenders, and what was he up to again. Cheng Dale sat and repeatedly calmed himself while he was about to play a string instrument. His hands gently reached for the strings. Cheng Dale sweated heavily as he panicked inside because he did not know how to play this instrument at all and he wanted to cosplay the prime music when it mattered but he did not have his talent. This was the bitter fruit of worshipping foreigners and not engaging in national studies. Cheng Dale kept thinking what he should do. Anyway, after all, it's just CDFGAH probably. He thought that it was not much different from the guitar. Cheng Dale started playing two tigers with the chords of CDEC and EFG repetitively. However, Lei Nu told his brother that the bandit was pretending and thought it was better to attack immediately, to which his brother, Lai Mu agreed to attack. Jiabu said that it must be magic when things were different than normal, and they should not make a move without careful consideration. Jiabu kept thinking while Cheng Dale continued playing his music. The clanging sound was like the waves breaking on the shore, like the wind blowing away the clouds. They thought Cheng Dale must have secretly had millions of troops, and it was like a mountain stream clear to the bottom. They couldn't do it without their mind at ease. Jiabu uttered that Cheng Dale must have a good plan. Pa Temin wondered how a few strings did so much and asked his brother why he couldn't figure it out by listening to what Jin Wendao thought before answering. He then proceeded to remember that Kai Mei was defeated in that battle because he fell for Cheng Dale's treacherous plan, so it was showing weakness to the enemy to lure him into the depths. Jiabu uttered that the heart was chaotic when the sound was too loud, the heart was calm when the sound was pure, the heart was panicked when the sound was wrong, the heart was beautiful when the sound was pure. Listening to him play was like watching his lungs. He was so relaxed. Jiabu believed that he must have set a trap for them, suggested they should not rush and passed on his military order to withdraw. 
his brothers objected to Jiabu's decision since they were having a hard time catching a good day, and he wanted to retreat. Lei Nu suddenly squeezed his horse's side with his leg and shouted an attack as they went on. Jiabu called out his sixth brother, told him to come back, and beware of getting trapped, while Jin went outside in disappointment and said that it's scary to be uneducated. Lei Nu advanced with his troops and commanded them to follow him. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale felt shivers all over his body, wondered why they were rushing over to attack, and his cosplay was not realistic enough. He ran and left his post immediately. This made the Ring tribe confused. Then, Jiabu commanded all troops to attack and the ring tribe advanced towards the gate and its high walls. They chanted charge as they went through the gate and wondered why they had not closed the gates at all. The ring tribe wondered where the people were, how come there was no one in sight, and when did they leave, or could it be that Cheng Dale could use the five elements escape techniques. Cheng Dale frantically ran away. He was sweating heavily and ran for his life while the ring tribe was behind, chasing him. Jia Bu on his horse commanded to catch him alive. Lei Nu added not to let this bandit escape, as he had a thousand ways to torture him. Cheng Dale kept running and arrived at the corner end of its walls while being chased by the rings. He took a step up the wall. Cheng Dale yelled as he took his last step. Then he took a huge leap while holding onto a rope. On the other side, his fellow bandits pulled the rope and told Cheng Dale to come up there. Jia Bu then commanded to shoot the arrows and kill him, withdrawing his earlier command to not take him alive. The rings began shooting arrows, targeting his head but kept missing Cheng Dale as he climbed the mountain. Eventually, Cheng Dale reached the top, and the rings could only curse at it. His fellow toad bandits asked Cheng Dale if he was alright, while the rings left behind were enraged. They let this bandit escape, called them a trash bandit, and threatened to send a squad up the mountain to catch them. Cheng Dale cheekily replied to the scum of the rings that he was able to come out, and they did not expect that, which pissed the princes of the rings off for being annoying. He had obviously escaped, and now he was deliberately showing himself off. Jiabu reminded Cheng Dale that no matter what they did, the mountain had already been occupied by them, so what else could he be proud of? Cheng Dale commanded his troops that it was time to leave and let them occupy the village for now. He smiled as he uttered that they would definitely be back. He praised Cheng Dale because he really picked an excellent place. It was Jiabu, and if he didn't give it up in the end, there would probably be a high price they were going to pay trying to conquer this place. He decided this was a good place for the troops. The officers of the empire entrenched themselves in useless forts. They didn't even pay attention to this awesome fortress. Jiabu continued his praise for the freshly cleared farmland, and its soil looked very fertile. He then laughed that Cheng Dale did a wonderful job making houses for them. Jiabu was approached by his brother and reported that the approximate location of the hidden treasure had been determined. It was buried deep in the ground and could be dug up at any time. It was Jin Wendao. Jiabu replied to inform the other to gather the workers as they would start digging tomorrow, and asked if the soldiers found any powder depot with gunpowder excavation would be much faster. Jin Wendao replied they were still searching. It was strange that the hiding place for such a large amount of gunpowder couldn't be found. He wondered where Cheng Dale had hidden it and it was reasonable to escape with food, but questioned if they also took gunpowder with them. Jiabu answered that it seemed to have run out, otherwise, they would not have run away so quickly. He then asked if there was any other loot. The soldiers found their arsenal, herbal stores, clothing stores, granaries, horse farms, and much more. The number of weapons and herbs in the warehouse was extremely high, and the quality was not bad. Jin Wendao remarked that no wonder they were able to fend off their iron cavalry for so long. The food that they captured weighed at least hundreds of thousands of pounds, not counting the food they took away. Such a small village actually stored so much food. There were still hundreds of war horses of all kinds in the paddock, and those were ones they couldn't take. The loot was quite good. Jiabu ordered Jin Wendao to inform the entire army that a feast for the entire army would be held that night in the mountain village. At night, the rings celebrated and drank wine over the bonfire, where the sky over the prairie was so blue, the endless grass, eternal heaven of eternity protected them. The rings raised their hands and swords in a celebratory feast of the bravest warriors on the grasslands and that they were unbeatable all the way to the top. The princes of the ring tribe sat together, laughed, and drank wine as well. They went on celebrating while a wooden crate flew in the air. Suddenly, this turned into a fiery blast, catching them off guard. All troops were alerted for an enemy attack originating up at the mountain. The rings noticed something up there and warned their fellow troops to search and watched out for their gunpowder. They realized that the trash bandit was back, urged them to come down there, and fought them fair and square while Cheng Dale laughed in surprise at their return. 
Jiabu was enraged and sarcastically replied that he still dared to come back. He was worried about not being able to kill him. Cheng Dalei called them foreign barbarians, beasts with long hair and horns inside their brains. When they saw the prosperity of his kingdom, they did not know how to make their own lands prosper. Instead, they set their unjust troops in motion to kill their people and took over their land. But they didn't know that he was the heir of the god of the South Pole, a friend of Tai Jingxing and Marshal Tianpeng. Cheng Dalei was the toad god, which confused the rings about what he was babbling about. He continued to say that the heaven ways were cruel, and its retribution would do them no good. Today, Cheng Dalei would execute the justice of God. If God did not punish them, Cheng Dalei would punish them. He raised his fiery torches and called for his brothers, lending him a hanging river of heaven. The toad bandits recognized the signal to break the dam, and they began tossing the wooden crates of gunpowder. With a loud bang, a flaming blast of explosion after explosion was apparent. As a result, large amounts of water and rock fragments broke through the dam. This caused panic in the Ring tribe because they thought Cheng Dalei really borrowed a river of heaven. Others began to drown. Other Ring members tried to run and flee to higher ground. They ran frantically while being warned to watch out for the rocks. Some got hit with rocks, while others panicked and yelled to get out of the way. Another explosion could be seen, which poured more water down with rock and wooden debris. A ring member hung himself on a tree as the water level rose dramatically and rapidly. It turns out that this place was not only suitable for soldiers but for burying people. Cheng Dalei sat on the edge of a mountain cliff near flooding water and said they had a lot of rain this year. During the day, they desperately tried to get in, and at night, they desperately tried to get out. Liu Bei stood near Cheng Dalei and sighed as he remarked that humans are really strange animals sometimes and praised him for a good job. Cheng Dalei replied, When the village was built, the military strategist said that the valley was actually not suitable for a mountain village. When the rainy season came, the village was extremely prone to flooding. He didn't expect his initial words to last to this day. That's why Cheng Dalei sent his brothers half a month ago to cut off the flow of water. Then there was an uninterrupted half month of rain. Liu Bei responded, The time, the place, and the people, those of the rings burned, killed, and looted, and did a lot of unjust things, really suffered the wrath of God. These hundred thousand people from the rings were buried here. It was time for the rings to end this march south ahead of time. This was an immeasurable merit to save people's lives, to which Cheng Dalei replied that no merit and no virtue were too great. Cheng Dalei thought in his head that Liu Bei was not aware of how frightening his fear points were now, so he urged him to go with him since there was nothing there to see anymore and find a place to rest. Liu Bei asked if they had picked up the others from the village. He answered they had no food and did not know when the chaos would end. When everything returned to normal, they would bring them back. A series of notification pop-ups informed Cheng Dalei that the brothers had completed missions, which were rewarded with upgraded skills, increased loyalty, and a greater sense of belonging. An excellent completion grade was given for annihilating the Northern Ringer, followed by rewards for Cheng Dalei's choosing. Another task was assigned to regroup the people for the construction of a new mountain village. Another notification was received, notifying Cheng Dalei that the system spirit had run out of power and was about to fall into a deep sleep. Since the village was destroyed, warning after warning began popping up. A few days later, crows soared overhead, and some stayed at the submerged toad village. Dead bodies of ring members piled up, soaked in water, with crows around. A man was still hanging himself from a tree. It was Jin Wendao who appeared sorrowful and awake but was still dripping in water on his face and hands. Someone coughed and fell into the water while crows continued to soar overhead and produced a cawing sound. Jin Wendao continued to cough as he fell over the dead bodies. This water was being walked through by someone. Jin Wendao had been lying down when he noticed someone walking through. This man witnessed the flood's aftermath and was still wandering through below knee-deep water beside the dead bodies. It was Fu Delay. If someone said this was hell on earth, then no one would object, and from ancient times to the present, there were only two kinds of existence that could get out of hell, one was the ghost, and the other was the devil. What were you? Were you a ghost or a devil? During this period of time, many other things happened within the Empire's borders. In the Northwest Border Gate, the defending General Lin Wenchen was defeated due to lack of food. When he raised his sword to kill himself, he was saved by his own soldiers and escorted all the way back to the capital. The Imperial Magistrate accused him of leading his troops poorly. Lin Wenchen was decreed to be beheaded by Emperor Ming. A lonely city in the Northwest, a shepherd posed as the sixth prince of the Empire and raised an army to resist the defenders of the city and was arrested by the officials. When he was about to be executed, he bribed the guards to escape and his whereabouts were unknown. 
at the northern tribe. Its king cried for a day and a night because all his ten sons died in Yuzhu. The next day, the king decided that it would be a good day and that he would make ten more princes. They had asked someone whether his mother was the one with big boobs and made him his eldest prince because he did a good somersault making him a somersault prince, a small and unknown clan of the Ring tribe. Someone uttered it was safe for her to stay there. It was a Ring member and told someone it was not easy for Kaime to get her out, reminding her not to tell outsiders her identity. Stay close to the princess and wait for them to return from the war. It was Green Cherry, dressed in a fur coat and holding one of the Ring member's signature accessories in her hands. She thought of her master Fu Delay and when he would be coming back, Cherry would wait for him there. Fast forward. Although the Ring Tribe army in Yuzhu was wiped out, the army formed by the other clans of the Ring Tribe drove straight in from Liangzhu. They fought all the way to the foot of the capital, and no one was able to stop them. Emperor Ming sent officials to negotiate peace with the Ring Tribe and accepted extremely harsh conditions. The Ring Tribe made a big uproar in the capital and left with a lot of money and goods. For a moment, the whole country was shocked. Countless scholars and talented people perished, and countless soldiers were killed. Wang, an imperial historian, was crushed to death in the hall. Before he died, he told the ten sins of Emperor Ming and called the peace talks the shame of the empire. Emperor Ming was furious and ordered his body to be flogged for ten days after his death, and his whole family was beheaded. In any case, the Ring tribe finally retreated, and the war was over. The displaced people could finally return home, bury their relatives, dry their tears, and continue to cultivate the land of their ancestors. Somewhere in the mountains, Cheng Dalei was told the water in their cottage had receded and suggested rebuilding the cottage, to which he replied there were a hundred thousand corpses in there and he was afraid of having nightmares when thought about it, not to mention living inside, then decided to change the place. Cheng Dalei ordered Gao Fei Hu to take a few people to collect surplus grain, remove the tents from the ring's camp, then go to the horse farm to see the animals that could swim, as there should be many surviving horses, and reminded to be careful because some of the rings were probably still alive, which he suggested taking a few more capable fighters with them, on which Gao Fei Hu agreed. Cheng Dalei told them to go ahead as he wanted to be alone, which his people respected and went first. He stood along near the edge of the mountain cliff. Then he sat silently. Cheng Dale summoned the system. He continued character summoning, lucky draw, and entered the store. On his floating blue pop-out screens, a series of warnings and system errors kept notifying. Cheng Dale had 10 million fear points on hand, but most of the system's functions were not available. Only the function status information could be used. He wondered if the system was malfunctioning. The previous upgrade was also dormant for a long time. But this was his first time Cheng Dale encountered system functions failure, or maybe it was under repair and did not know how long it would take this time. When the system was not around, Cheng Dale always felt empty in his heart. Suddenly, a voice emerged. Cheng Dale looked behind, thinking it was the system that was awake. However, it was the lottery machine. Cheng Dale questioned why the lottery machine was there. The lottery machine responded why he seemed to be very disappointed when it was him and not the system's spirit. The lottery machine sighed, crossed its arms, and then started spinning around Cheng Dale's head, making fun of him for looking so soulless and disappointed, which he complained and begged to stop because it was making him dizzy. Cheng Dale asked the lottery machine if it knew something he could tell him because most system functions were not working where he had 10 million of unused fear points and wondered what was wrong with the system. He continued asking how long would it take for her to wake up, which made the lottery machine speechless for a moment then responded that it was considered very unlikely the system spirit would awaken from that deep sleep. This shocked Cheng Dale and questioned what it meant. Lottery Machine explained the system had an error and was bugging. The system spirit was asleep inside the system, so there was no way for her to wake up. It added that he didn't have to worry about the system not working, assuring him the self-repair worked perfectly. As soon as the system initiated a reset of the data, it could return to its original form. Cheng Dale asked if the system spirit would be able to wake up after the reset. Lottery Machine responded no and explained when the system was reset, a mind body like them, which was born with the system, would also be reset. All the data would be deleted and reset to the initial state. But the spirit system was a very special spiritual entity who was above the Lottery Machine, and after the reset she may never be born like her previous state. 
Cheng Dale asked if it meant that resetting the system would make the system's spirit disappear, and questioned how could things end like this. Lottery Machine scratched its head and responded that it was complicated to say the least. First of all, the system itself was always managed and maintained by the system's spirit. In the lower level of the permissions were the lottery machine, the summoning platform, and the store. The prosperous development of the village was the source of her power. The stronger the village was, the stronger the power the system's spirit could wield. The fear point, on the other hand, was an external force that emanated from the masses, which was chaotic and could not be easily controlled. Normally, the system's spirit always managed to control it. When the system spirit used up all her strength and fell into a deep sleep so that Cheng Dale could evacuate all the village inhabitants, originally, she just wanted to sleep for a few days and wait for him to rescue the people, then build a new village in another place so she could wake up and regenerate her power. However, Cheng Dale just flooded the entire village at once, this destroyed the village, her energy source was then shattered, and she had no way to regenerate energy again and the sea of fear points of hundreds of thousands ringers also hit the system at the same time. The destruction of the village rendered her powerless and it also took the buffer out of those chaotic fear points. This effect of 10 million points was so intense that the defenseless system itself reported it as an error. At that point, the system spirit was in the weakest state of deep sleep and had no way to protect and repair the system herself. The lottery machine ended its explanation. In short, it was Cheng Dale who played too hard and drove the system to death while pointing its finger at him, which shocked Cheng Dale. The lottery machine kept pointing its finger then asked if he got that, and Cheng Dale remained silent at the moment. Cheng Dale asked if he wanted to restore the system. He could only reset the system and no other way around. The lottery machine answered yes. He could only reset the system if he wanted it to function properly again, which made Cheng Dale silent. He asked again about the system reset, assuring they knew how to reset it, otherwise why would the lottery machine be so calm? The lottery machine was a mass production type, it was just a matter of sleeping, and the memory could be stored, but not for the system spirit, she is a very special individual, and the system had no way to rewrite her data. Cheng Dale was silent once more before he asked if she disappeared, then the reset system would remain without an administration just like an empty shell, and the lottery machine answered that when the time comes, a new administrator would be born, but it wouldn't be the system spirit, talking about an empty shell. The lottery machine added if Cheng Dale could find the empty shell from the system, he might be able to keep the system spirit, she depended on this system to survive in the world. Cheng Dale just had to find a container to keep her, take her out one at a time, and then Cheng Dale could reset the system without hurting her, and when the system was done resetting, he could merge her with the system itself. Cheng Dale inquired, what exactly was that container? The lottery machine answered that anything the system itself had ever owned could be used as a container. Cheng Dale inquired more, what did the lottery machine mean? Then the lottery machine explained the system itself was a divine thing that transcended the world. It used to possess many objects, and as long as it possessed one of them, that object got strange powers. People who owned this item would end up doing something great and could occupy a key position in history. They could store the system spirit in the possessions that the system owned, and that's the kind Cheng Dale should be looking for. Cheng Dale questioned how it could become a system in his case, since it could possess objects. The lottery machine hesitantly explained this, sighed, and begged him not to bring this up. But since Cheng Dale crossed over because of his sudden death while playing games, because when it owned something, it always had to pick the most valuable thing on the host to own. But Cheng Dale was just a single soul when he crossed over, so when it fused, it directly chose what was most precious to him personally, the memories and knowledge from the other world. It always had a concrete picture, so he chose the system that his brain imagined. The lottery machine laughed and continued explaining, a game system was born, something that only a traveler like Cheng Dale could imagine. System spirit was born when his memories were fused with the system. The lottery machine asked Cheng Dale if he knew the name she gave herself, to which he answered Yi Zin, and the lottery machine agreed. She was the system spirit, she was a unique, non-imitable model of the mind. She would follow you step by step as he grew, and she was the person who knew him best in the world. She helped him fix bugs that should be blocked, drew cards to cheat, and helped him call the shots, since she was his heart. This made Cheng Dale speechless. He thought of her heart. Determined, Cheng Dale inquired how he could find such a container, to which the lottery machine replied about the relics of kings and princes, the higher the power. Cheng Dale inquired for an example. The lottery machine answered, the founding emperor of the empire, Lai Manzi, who ended the disputes of 19 countries and the founding emperor of the Great Battle Kingdom. 
he was the most probable and chronologically closest existing great name on which Cheng Dalei understood. It seemed that Cheng Dalei could no longer linger in this little kin new mountain to wake up this sleepy little fool. It was time to go out into the world and do something meaningful. At the Yuzhu official road, a horse carriage was navigating the mountain road. They were having a conversation inside the carriage. Someone said that it was trouble for Eunuk Liu to take this bumpy journey, which he hoped Eunuk Liu was not suffering. Eunuk Liu answered they were all doing this work for his majesty. There was no such thing as suffering, it was their good fortune. Court eunuch Liu Aji added that the people of Yuzhu have suffered because of the Warring Ring tribes. Now he had a great victory. The Kui family had chosen a good son-in-law. Kui Yun Giant of the Kui family sighed as he replied that they should have done this for the country and the people. The carriage was almost upon the city of Yuzhu. A few moments later, Yang Longting on horseback inquired if the men had arrived yet, to which a soldier replied telling him not to worry. The scouts reported that they were still 10 miles away from them. Yang Longting thought of getting off his horse and meeting them since they were 10 miles away. An old man beside him reminded his lord that he did not have to do that because he was a noble. Yang Longting explained that the eunuch who delivered the order this time was the close friend of Emperor Ming. A single word from him in the emperor's ear could determine the fate of a person. The old man inquired if it was Liu Aji of the inner court, which Yang Longting confirmed. The old man added that with his status, he was willing to suffer on his journey to travel this far. A horse carriage arrived, and Yang Longting of Yuzhu welcomed Eunuch Liu and Lord Kui. Eunuch Liu humbly responded that there was no need to greet them. He was a meritorious hero of the empire. He did not have to salute them like this. It was offending them. Yang Longting respectfully replied to Lord Liu and invited him to talk in the city. They went inside the city with utmost respect and formalities. Later, Liu Aji still insisted that he did not need to be so serious. They were only here to convey his majesty's wishes and they were all admirable officials, so all other formalities were exempted. This time, the Ring tribe rebelled against their empire. Although they were finally driven away, the people were in a miserable state. Liu Aji added that especially in Yuzhu, they were directly facing the most powerful northern clan of the Ring tribe. And finally, they survived, which was a great honor for them. Yang Longting responded that it was for the country and the people. It was only a matter of duty. Liu Aji continued, stating that his majesty said those who should be punished would be, and those who should be rewarded would be, so that the people of the world could see there were heroes in the empire, and no reward for heroes was too much. This time, Yang Longting did a great job. When Liu Aji left for the capital, he would ask the historian in the capital to write a biography about him. When the time came, Yang Longting would be invited to the capital and would teach others how to fight. He laughed, because the Lord of Yuzhu was also famous in the first war against the rings. Liu Aji went on to say his majesty was very pleased and once said if the empire had such brave generals and warriors who had no fear, what could the ring tribe do? Fang Boshan inquired if his majesty knew him as well, to which Liu Aji answered he was often mentioned. Fang Boshan thought that was strange. It was not surprising that Yang Longting had made great contributions, but he had been hiding in Qingzhou. It was obvious Cheng Dalei defeated the ring tribe. He wondered what it had to do with him. Lord Fang Boshan continued to wonder if it was because the mountain bandit showed off the king's seal of Yuzhu and the lord's seal of Loy City every day. People who did not know the truth saw it and thought Yang Longting and I sent him to defend the city. When the story reached the capital, they thought it was him and Yang Longting defending Kin New Mountain and wiping out a hundred thousand enemies. Fang Boshan believed this was a truly great opportunity that fell from the sky. Yang Longting responded humbly that Lord Clumsy Tongues only knew to bury their heads in the battlefield, so for the book to establish a biography, it was really not appropriate. But on his head, Yang Longting could not say he did not even fight in this war. Liu Aji replied that he was too modest and there was one more small thing. Liu Aji inquired who Cheng Dalei was, as he would like to meet him. All the city lords were left speechless. Yang Longting, unable to respond, was questioned by Liu Aji and inquired what was wrong. The Lord had such a brave general, why hide it? Yang Longting eventually retorted that Cheng Dalei was a mountain bandit. Liu Aji heard that he was originally entrenched in Kin New Mountain, but Yang Longting recruited him at his command. So what if he was a bandit? He defeated the Ring tribe and now he's the Empire's hero. Yang Longting found a great talent for the Empire and did not let Liang Yu be buried in the mountains. Yang Longting responded that he was doing what he was supposed to do. His Majesty the Ming's Emperor said, City Lord Fang and Cheng Dalei contributed three parts in repelling the Ring tribe, and they were both to be given credit for the three points each. They laughed because they believed His Majesty was too kind, which made this humble servant terrified. 
Liu Aji inquired where Cheng Dale was and could they let him meet him first. It was best to take him to the capital so that his majesty could also meet him. Yang Longting responded that those vulgar mountain people did not know etiquette. He originally was a mountain bandit, and he was afraid he would offend eunuch Liu. Yang Longting added that in the future, he would listen to the teachings of eunuch Liu, to which he agreed and commended. Liu Aji replied that in fact, he had another purpose for coming there because this time the Ring Tribe Rebellion disrupted the country and led to numerous deaths for the Empire. The Imperial Court decided to launch the martial arts competition, and the date was set in a year. His brave generals should not have been too proud to send them to the capital, participate in the martial arts competition, and compete with the other heroes around the world. Someone asked that the court seemed to attach great importance to this martial arts competition, and he responded that his majesty personally decided that. It was almost night time. Yang Longting sat across the table and asked his second brother about the situation in the capital where his second brother, Qi Yun Giant, responded that the empire lost miserably in the war when the army of the Ring tribe came to the city and forced his majesty to sign the treaty which concluded the enemy that had reached the city wall. However, the Yuzhu side actually wiped out more than a hundred thousand enemy troops. As a result, the empire dared to negotiate peace with the Ring tribe entirely because of this war. Their victory was so precious in their case of total defeat. His majesty would now need to greatly reward the Yuzhu brave general, so the whole country knew they did not lose miserably. Therefore, his brother-in-law would be treated as a hero, and the Qi family will also have the power to voice out in the court because a certain imperial official actually filed a complaint against their Qi family. Qi Yun Jian went on to say that a certain person had a birthday and didn't come to celebrate. Could it be that two families had a grudge, and the two kept talking to each other for a long time? Qi Yun Jian inquired about the exact situation about Cheng Dale. Yang Longting answered that he was not easy to deal with, and Qi Yun Jian asked if he didn't listen to him. In his mind, Yang Longting thought not only he didn't listen to him but if he met him, his axe would kill and chop his heart into pieces. Yang Longting responded it was not that he didn't completely listen to him, but the mountain bandits didn't like being controlled. Qi Yun Jian insisted that this person must be controlled by him, which was very important, and Yang Longting understood. Additionally, he asked to prepare two teenage girls and send them to serve in Eunuch Liu's rooms tonight, which Yang Longting assured was already ready, and inquired whether Eunuch liked women, to which Qi Yun Jian chuckled and said that it was a hobby of the officials. The moon and stars filled the sky as night fell. Three o'clock came, and a shadow was observed entering a room. Fang Boshin was visited and talked about this year's thin horses, reminded not to forget to send them to the capital, and the number couldn't be less. However, Fang Boshin responded to his lord that when the Ring tribe came, the thin horses that survived were not easy to raise nor catch. The road over Skull Island was cut off, had no idea how long it would take to make a new one. In other words, he must first raise enough numbers. If it was really not working well, they would go to the small villages to catch some, which his lord agreed. The morning came at the temporary toad village at the foot of Queen Yu Mountain, where Cheng Dale was asked whether they should pick their brothers who fled to the south or rather they go directly to the south to develop. Huang Sangun reported that Yuzhu was too poor for them mountain bandits and if they continued to rob there, they would become even poorer. The south was good, Jiangnan had so many beauties, and the government soldiers were also more powerful. Cheng Dale replied there was no need to hurry. They could first dig out the buried treasure inside the valley, so that their brothers who went to the south could have enough capital to develop. The bandits were busy and running errands. Cheng Dale laid down his back against piles of sacks, thinking about the valley being still flooded. The treasure inside could not be dug out for the time being, and where could he find a container that would hold the system spirit? He was contemplating moving everyone to the south to develop or just move to the capital, and becoming a mountain bandit in the capital didn't feel worth it. Cheng Dale couldn't decide where to go next. A bandit informed Cheng Dale that he caught a hare, which he replied to kill and made it into a jerky. Another bandit came and told Cheng Dale they found hundreds of horses that amazingly didn't drown, which he mistakenly replied to kill but to put them to work. Another bandit found a wild boar, which he ordered to kill and make it into jerky. This became a repetitive order of Cheng Dale every time his people caught something. While they were out butchering pigs, Zhang Fei informed Cheng Dale that a man came and claimed to have orders from the Lord of Yuzhu and wanted to recruit them. But Cheng Dale was sound asleep while Xiao Qiang was calling his name. Suddenly, Cheng Dale blurted out to kill him and make him into jerky, and Zhang Fei agreed, which scared Xian Qiang. He pleaded with Cheng Dale to recognize that Xiao Qiang was his brother as he frantically called Cheng Dale to confirm it was him. Cheng Dale woke up and confirmed that he was him. 
then they couldn't kill him, so he ordered the third elder to put away the sword first. Xiao Kang explained that he and Cheng Dalei felt like old friends at the first meeting. It was better to be sworn brothers than blood brothers. However, Cheng Dalei ordered the third elder to cut off his hands and feet, then feed them to the pigs and throw him in the cesspit, which made him more horrified. As the third elder moved him away from Cheng Dalei, he ordered to take care of him and not to bother him if it wasn't anything important. While Xiao Kang pleaded again to Cheng Dalei that he shouldn't disown his brother, Xiao Kang yelled if Cheng Dalei wanted to become a city lord. This made him curious. Cheng Dalei ordered the third elder to wait and listen first to what he had to say. A few moments later, they were threatening him with this sword near his neck, talking about shaving his beard and trying it out on him because his beard looked a little long to him. Xiao Kang begged to stop making fun of him while Cheng Dalei interrogated him as to why on earth he really came here. Xiao Kang sweated heavily as he explained that among the four cities, Blackstone, Fallen Leaves, Red Sand, and Iron River, Cheng Dalei could choose any of them. His lord would request this from the imperial court and reward it to him. Cheng Dalei questioned what he was trying to say. Xiao Kang further explained that Cheng Dalei had turned the tide this time, defeated the Ring tribe by holding onto Kin Niu Mountain. It was said that he had made great contributions, and his lord couldn't let Cheng Dali bleed and shed tears. Tomorrow, his lord was going to host a banquet in the Rain and Wind Pavilion. The villagers, nobles, soldiers, and generals of Yuzhu would all be there, and all brothers of Toad Village could join them. The people of Yuzhu were waiting to see all the heroes, but Gao Fei who questioned the Rain and Wind Pavilion again. Xiao Kang chuckled that before tomorrow, Cheng Dalei better decide which city to choose so his lord could also make early arrangements. Everyone had to attend, he would be waiting for them in the rain and wind pavilion tomorrow. The toad bandits talked about which city would be most suitable for them and were surprised that Yang Longting gave them a city which they didn't expect in the battle, and at least they didn't fight for nothing. They went on talking since Blackstone had been destroyed, definitely not in consideration, so they had three cities left to decide, Fallen Leaves, Red Sand, and Iron River. They were cheerfully excited and kept talking about their promising future of becoming young generals as it would bring honor to their ancestors rather than being mountain bandits, and people would not think of them as bandits anymore. They giggled as if it were a blessing in disguise, despite losing their toad village, but they got a city and having a city they could do business in confidence, and the land would be more prosperous than before while Cheng Dale sat still. Cheng Dalei thought that perhaps after becoming a city lord, there would be more ways to find containers for the system, also find a good way for his brothers, while as for the treasure buried in the valley, they could dig it up later, anyway their legs would not grow if they continued running, and they would be able to get it when he became a city lord. Cheng Dalei stood up and called the attention of his brothers. They would pack up that night and go to the rain and wind pavilion the next morning. The toad bandits enthusiastically raised their hands to show that they would follow Cheng Dalei's plan. The next morning, in a mass burial with an offering and gravestone, they visited their brothers and told them their blood had not been shed in vain. Cheng Dalei retorted that they all survived and their mountain fortress was destroyed. The Ring tribe had been driven away so their parents and children could live in peace, they were going to live a good life and no longer be spurned by others. Cheng Dalei went on to say they were all leaving and it was time to say goodbye to this place forever. Even if they came back to visit them, they wouldn't be mountain bandits anymore. Cheng Dalei rode his horse and ordered his brothers to go. At Yuzhu official road, where the toad bandits were on horseback traveling the mountain road, they were talking and laughing on their journey. The law-abiding people were depressed every day. The ruffians sang merrily every night, riding a mule and harming others for its own benefits starving with integrity and fairness, building or repairing bridges and mending roads for the blind, murdering and arsoning many children. Cheng Dalei and his people saw an old man and child on their way. While the old man kept talking, he went to the western heavens and asked his Buddha, and Buddha said he could not do anything. Cheng Dalei approached the old man and a child on his horse with a loud thud, carrying a banner that read, See Through the Human World. Cheng Dalei was about to be passed by the old man when the old man abruptly stopped. He looked back and asked where they were going. Cheng Dalei said that they were going forward then the horse stopped moving. The old man replied, don't go, go back, and there was no way forward there. Cheng Dalei inquired why he couldn't go further, was the road being repaired. The old man turned and explained that he was an old Taoist, knew roughly about righteousness, he understood a bit about yin and yang. He traveled around the world and told people the future to make a living. The old man approached near Cheng Dalei and inquired if he would like the ancient Taoist to predict the future for him. 
he responded to what he was able to do, like palm reading with bones, eight years of hand signs, yin and yang or astrology. The old man chuckled as he stroked his beard. Cheng Dalei inquired if he could do it all, to which the old man replied he couldn't do any of it. Cheng Dalei kept inquiring about tarot horoscopes, purple power, or spirit summoning to which the old man replied no. If he really couldn't do anything, he could just tell him a joke to which the old man was silent. Cheng Dalei, who seemed irritable, inquired more about what he knew. The old man replied that he would never be able to do astrology. He knew nothing about palm reading with bones. There was only one thing that he could do, it was to see through the human world and let God show him the way. Cheng Dalei inquired if he could show him the way too, to which the old man replied he only knew a little bit about it. The old man went on to say that there was no way to move forward. If he continued there was only death, which Cheng Dalei asked what if he went back. The old man responded that going back, there was no hope waiting for them. Nine times out of ten of them would die. Cheng Dalei then had to ask the old man, where was his way of being alive? The four divine states and the eight heavenly realms were his paths to existence. The old man replied. Cheng Dalei was silent and looked pissed. The old man continued with his phrase, see through the human world. Cheng Dalei got off his horse which made the old man confused. While approaching the old man, he remained silent and prepared his arm. Suddenly, his fist landed on the old man's face and fiercely yelled to eat his fist. Cheng Dalei continued to punch at the old man, chastising him for what happened when certain people didn't speak clearly, while the child man was scared for his master. Cheng Dalei went on beating the old man and complained that what he hated the most in life was the mystery man while the old man begged for him to stop and show some mercy as his face was visibly bruised. The old man yelled at Cheng Dalei that he would die soon and yet he was still so ignorant. For a moment, he was confused but still he wanted to eat his fist. The child treated the bruised old man as Cheng Dalei asked whether he could speak more clearly now, to which the old man responded that he wanted to find a shady place to talk. Later, the old man inquired if Cheng Dalei wanted to go to the rain and wind pavilion, which surprised him that he already knew. They both sat across from each other. Cheng Dalei chuckled that it seemed news traveled fast while the old man asked what he was going to do in the rain and wind pavilion. He laughed as he explained that Yang Longting was willing to give him a city with him as the ruler. The people of Yuzhu would also come, probably a recognition meeting or something, while Zhu Shenji advised him that it was better not to talk to him about such confidential matters. The old man sighed as he reminded Cheng Dalei was such a heroic person but couldn't even see the trick in it to which he inquired what he meant. The old man continued to explain that the Wind and Rain Pavilion was not only a recognition conference, but was fully hoarded by officers and soldiers. There were no mountains of seafood and food waiting for them but swords and cannons, then proceeded to ask how he felt about it. Cheng Dalei replied that he still had to ask the Taoist master for advice. The old man explained that he won the battle and not only wrecked the rings but also solved the crisis of the empires. With this fight, it wouldn't even be too much to make him a king. Cheng Dalei asked if Yang Longting coveted his credit, to which the old man replied it was not greed, which he felt relieved hearing it. However, the old man went on to say the credit was originally Yang Longting's, which enraged and shocked mountain bandits. The old man mumbled that Yang Longting, the lord of Yuzhu, seemed to be such a heroic figure that he was not retreating in the war against the Ring tribe and wiped out 100,000 enemies. He guessed that the people around the world today said that he was the war god in the empire. The old man continued that countless literary talents generously wrote about him, even in songs of singers, and in the mouths of the tea house narrator, you could hear his heroic wonder. As he brushed his beard, the old man mumbled that he heard that the palace was willing to erect a monument to Yang Longting on King Niu Mountain so that future generations could remember the deeds of the King of Yuzhou. Gao Fei Hu and his men were enraged, saying that Yang Longting was such a coward, as he only knew how to flee when he saw the rings, and never fought a battle while the others cursed at Yang Longting, as they had done those things. Cheng Dalei chimed in that Yang Longting was greedy enough to take credit for their work, and since it was not clear to the palace, he would find a way to tell them and not let the coward be hailed as a hero. The old man believed that there was no point if he wanted to explain it to the palace. Cheng Dalei questioned why it was pointless. The old man sighed and said that Cheng Dalei was giving him the impression that he really knew nothing about the policy of the government. He asked him if he thought that he would receive the government's reward if he won a battle as he claimed that it was not like that. The old man informed him that the policy of the government was far more complex than he could imagine, and so the same thing could produce a completely different result for different people. For example, the Northwest General Lin Wenchen, he fought the Ring tribe and refused to retreat, and eventually ran out of food, causing him to be unfortunately defeated. But he was considered a disgrace to the kingdom 
and instead of dying by the rings, General Lin was executed in the palace, and his grave was spat upon after his death. The old man asked if anyone really knew what Yang Longting was, he disagreed, and it's something that many people didn't even want to know. And as long as the people around Emperor Ming said one thing, that Lord of Yuzhu fought well. Cheng Dale was contemplating as he listened to what the old man was saying that countless people would benefit from this, and those who benefit will hold Yang Longting up as the god of war of the empire. He questioned Cheng Dale's identity as he was just a mountain bandit that didn't fit in anywhere. The old man asked who could benefit from his victories. When he said he fought the war, they would say, that was a mountain bandit who also wanted to compete with the merits of the god of war of the empire, and they asked how low he was. He concluded that a lost battle could become a won battle, and a coward could become a war hero, and that now Yang Longting has become the idol of the imperial soldiers and has been given a higher rank. But many people in Yuzhu knew that he actually was nothing to do with the contribution made by a mountain bandit named Cheng Dale. As the old man pointed at Cheng Dale, he said that if Yang Longting wanted to have a good time, he had to control this mountain bandit. And there were two ways to control him. One was to make him one of yourself, but he knew that this mountain bandit was clearly not a master of obedience. As the old man was about to say another method, Cheng Dale's face darkened as he added that it was to kill him, to which the man agreed. Cheng Dale clasped both his hands, thanking the old man for his guidance, saying that he couldn't thank him enough for his kindness, as he also asked the Taoist master to show them again which path they should take next. The master closed his eyes and paused. He began muttering Cheng Dale's name, suddenly raised his staff, saying that he had just hit him really hard. The staff struck Cheng Dale's head, turning his face dark. The master sighed as he felt much better now. Concerned, Gao Fei Hu and the others called for their village master, while the other men asked the master what he was doing. Cheng Dale's hands trembled and he told his men not to be rude to the Taoist master. He mumbled that if it had not been for the Taoist master today, he would still be living in a dream and had made his men jump into the fire with him without anything. Cheng Dale called the Taoist master again, clasping both of his hands, asking him for guidance for the subordinate to unravel a secret. The master said that he would tell him more. He informed him that the front of Yuzhu had done splendidly, and all the city lords were trying to collect the benefits. So the lord of Yuzhu was by no means the only one who wanted to kill him. The master started drawing on the ground and said the first thing was that Yuzhu's army was waiting in ambush near the rain and wind pavilion for him to fall into their trap. While the fallen leaf city, Kisha city, Beijing city, T city, and other forces with a large army surrounded and blocked the surrounding terrain. As most of the official roads were blocked, the master continued that the entire Yuzhu would be the hunting ground for rounding up all of them. He suggested that they should all split up and go into the woods to hide from pursuers, or by water to the south side of the river or by mountain trails to other states, and someone had to break the encirclement and keep the larger group at bay. The master said that King Yu Mountain was a complex terrain that had not yet been blocked by the big army, and there was still a chance to go today. He added that it was better for them to set out early before the army arrived. Gao Fei who told Cheng Dalia that they shouldn't go and should be afraid of them and should kill them in a fight as they had chased the Ring tribe away. Cheng Dale responded that they couldn't fight, now that the whole Yuzhu army was ready to kill them, and that those people didn't have the guts to fight the Ring tribe, but they had a lot of guts to fight their own people. He told his men to listen up and said that they couldn't escape with their large numbers together, so they had to evacuate separately. He ordered them not to leave anyone behind if they could and that those who could fight would take the weak ones with them. Cheng Dale called Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei Bao and ordered them to take 100 people disguised as refugees and retreated to the mountain forest. Next, he called Huang San Yuan and said to take 300 people back to the mountain fortress and distribute the dry food in the mountain fortress and spread out to leave from King Niu Mountain, to which Huang San Yuan agreed. Cheng Dale warned them that it was now the territory of the Ring tribe, asking them to beware of the Ring troops. He proceeded to order Xiao Bailan to use the water route and go to Jiangnan, taking with her the Su family and Liu family, which she also agreed to. Concerned, Su Ying called for Cheng Dale. Liu Jihan added, mumbling as she knew what Cheng Dale was doing but was interrupted, as Cheng Dale ordered his men to bring him his weapon while he commanded them to take what way. Liu Jihan clenched her fist and closed her eyes. She took the courage to speak and called for him as she charged at him with teary eyes. Sobbing, Liu Jihan hugged him and told him that they had just finished the war. While watching the events, Xiao Bailan and Su Ying blushed as they listened to what Liu Jihan said, asking Cheng Dale if he wanted to leave them again and take risks himself. Cheng Dale told her to be obedient, as it was not the time to throw tantrums. Crying, Liu Jihan pleaded not to leave them alone. 
Cheng Dale said that it would get too hard if they went together, and besides, their target was him. And when it was safe, he would find her. As Liu Jihan's tantrums were about to end, she told him that it was settled and he should make sure not to forget about her. She reached for Cheng Dale and kissed him. Xiaoda's excitement showed as she said to Su Ying to look and to control herself. She yelled at Liu Jihan, saying, that was enough, as there was no time for being lovey-dovey. She pushed Liu Jihan away, telling her to move. However, Liu Jihan was still sobbing. Cheng Dale coughed to gather all their attention. He announced that the rest of his men were all set. Cheng Dale continued, saying that there were only a few of them left, and all of them had the highest fighting power among the mountain bandits. Liu Bei, Zhang Fei, Guan Yu, and Zhao Zilong, as well as Lin Xiao Yu, Lin Chong, Kin Man, and Zhu Shenji, listened to Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale ordered them to give their men time to retreat. His face distorted as he asked Zhu Shenji what he was doing there. Zhu Shenji answered that he would go with him. Cheng Dale's hands crossed his face, and he thought that it was late for Zhu Shenji to follow the others. He agreed to Zhu Shenji and said that he and Kin Man would ride on the same horse, otherwise, he would easily fall behind. Cheng Dale turned his attention to the Taoist master and his disciple, thanking him for his help today and asking him that he should also leave as it was not safe to stay with them. The master bowed and said, If the green mountain remains unchanged and the stream of water is crystal clear, the Taoist priest could see the future empire and will still be able to hear the name of Cheng family. Cheng Dale gave him a good laugh as he clasped both of his hands and said that he thought of it as a farewell blessing. The disciple watched and wondered how Cheng Dale could still laugh in that kind of situation. Cheng Dale noticed the disciple and asked who he was. The master responded while patting the head of the disciple that it was his apprentice, Hong Chen, as he continued that they would meet again in the future in Jianghu someday and wished him to take care. The lottery machine information popped up as Hong Chen's age was just 14. However, his skills and experience were still unknown. Cheng Dale claimed that the two master and apprentice were really mysterious. As he saw them leave, Cheng Dale was asked by one of his men where they would go. Cheng Dale said that the rest of their mountain fortress brothers were fleeing in the north, and he thought of where they were going. He said that they were heading west. Somewhere in the Qingyu Mountain, a group of people gathered. A soldier reported to Kai Degang that the road was closed, but their target hadn't yet appeared, and wondered if they could be aware of them. Kai Degang ordered his men to scout again. Suddenly, Cheng Dale and his men came running with a horse. He greeted Kai Degang and told him that he was coming. Kai Degang, anxious, said that he was finally here. Cheng Dale asked him what was wrong, why he was so serious, to which Kai Degang stutteringly answered nothing. He giggled and asked Cheng Dale and said why was he so slow as Yang Longting sent him to pick him up. He also asked where the other brothers of his mountain fortress were and how come only a few of his brothers came. Cheng Dale answered that they're dressing up on the mountain fortress, as they're all rude people who haven't seen the world, and that they're so excited that they didn't sleep all night thinking about what to wear today. He told Kai Degang that he's afraid that Yang Longting was waiting for them anxiously, and asked that they should come over first. Kai Degang awkwardly told Cheng Dale that it is best for him not to call his lord by his name. However, Cheng Dale just laughed it off and said that it was his fault as it should be the king of Yuzhu, or it's my lord, as they'll become city lords of their own people in the future. Kai Degang asked him since they met, to come with him as his lord was waiting for him, to which Cheng Dale answered that they're going together. As they both walked side by side, Cheng Dale said that he's going to pay a formal visit to his lord today, and he's going to give him a sword which was seized from a prince of the Ring tribe. He asked him if he would help him check if the sword is suitable for his lord. Curious, Kai Degang asked which sword was it and if he could show it to him. Cheng Dale's face darkened as he unsheathed the sword telling Kai Degang what the sword was called. He struck Kai Degang with the sword as he told that the sword's name was the straightforward sword. Blood splashed out of Kai Degang's neck. As he fell off his horse he croaked one last time saying that it was a good sword. Cheng Dale turned to his men, asking them to kill all of them. He called for Lin Xiaoyu and Lin Chong to break the formation charge, to which the both did so. Lin Chong unleashed his seven-fold wave breaker spear, while Lin Xiaoyu did the five-fold wave breaker spear. The soldiers were quickly demolished as Zhao Zhilong's white bird pilgrim spear pierced through them. Another soldier was hit by Cheng Dale's Alfie's fast sword straightforward skill. Kin Man, while Zhu Shenji rode on his back, asked Cheng Dale what way it was. Cheng Dale told him not to get attached to the battle and go west. A group of soldiers chased after them as they shouted to get Cheng Dale, no matter dead or alive. Like a wolf pack that smelled meat, the ambushers around the area came out. Cheng Dale successfully attracted his pursuers to the west. 
Yuzhou City, Fallen Leaf City, Red Sand City, North Town City, and Iron River City were five cities that had a total of more than 30,000 troops. As Cheng Dalei's group was still chased, he ordered his men not to let them form an encircling net and to go to the mountains. While the soldiers were ordered to advance in full force and outflank and to kill the traitor Cheng Dalei, Zhang Fei informed them that Lin Xiaoyu and Lin Chong were surrounded. Lin Chong raised the army with his Wave Breaker Spear Army Breaker skill. Lin Xiaoyu yelled, telling Cheng Dalei to get out and not to worry about them. With his face darkened, Lin Xiaoyu told them not to look back. Struggling, Lin Chong suggested to Lin Xiaoyu that they would break out from the other direction, distracting some of their pursuers. Meanwhile, the third army of Fallen Leaf City had arrived, and the seventh army of Red Sand City also arrived as they were ordered to surround them. Another man announced that the 1st, 5th, and 6th armies of Yuzhu City had arrived while raising their banners. The soldiers chanted to kill the traitor Cheng Dalei, while the others were ordered to shoot arrows as the city lord had ordered them to capture them alive. Cheng Dalei's group arrived in some narrow way. Zhang Fei grinned as he felt interested that there were more and more pursuers. Guan Yu, on the other hand, told them not to stay in the plain and to go into the deep mountains. Zhao Zilong added that there's a fork road ahead and that he'll wait for his brother and they'll distract the pursuers. He told Cheng Dalei to take the opportunity to enter the mountain, while Liu Bei told them to turn left and bid his farewell to Cheng Dalei. The group was separated in two as the soldiers were still chasing them. Cheng Dalei swooped into the mountain forest and his trail was hard to find. The 30,000 troops camped at the bottom of the mountain were sealing the intersection out of the mountain. The army surrounded the mountain layer by layer, advancing and gradually narrowing the blockade. The evacuation of the mountain bandits went smoothly. Most of them had already withdrawn from the Yuzhu area. Three days later, the blockade left only a few mountain ranges. As night fell on the third day, a few soldiers were holding torches, and someone yelled to kill Cheng Dalei. No matter what, they had to finish him off. An order came that those who were successful killers would be rewarded with a hundred tails of gold and would secure the right to be a general. Whoever found Cheng Dalei would be rewarded with a hundred tails of silver and become a commander of a hundred soldiers, which made them drop their jaws. In a hidden cave somewhere in the blockade circle, Cheng Dalei informed his men that he didn't know what had happened to Lin Xiaoyu and whether they were in danger or not. Zhu Shenji retorted that the officers and soldiers had come after them, believing that Lin Xiaoyu should have escaped while bandaging Kin Man. Concerned, Cheng Dalei asked Kin Man if he could see how his injuries were, to which Kin Man answered that he could hold it and it was no big deal. However, Cheng Dalei still insisted on letting him see. Then suddenly a hand hit Kin Man's nape, and Kin Man's face darkened as he fell to the ground. Zhu Shenji was shocked and called out to Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei interrupted, saying that the soldiers were, in fact, coming for him, believing that if he left, they would be safe. Zhu Shenji argued and told him not to do anything stupid, that if they didn't go together, he might not be able to get out. Cheng Dalei also snapped Zhu Shenji's neck, making him unconscious. As Zhu Shenji's sight faded, he heard Cheng Dalei saying that after he lured the soldiers away, he should get the opportunity to leave. Zhu Shenji's sight faded slowly as he called his village master in his thoughts. At some part of the mountain, there was a hidden cave. The soldiers were yelling to charge. Cheng Dalei held his sword in front of him as he rode his horse charging towards the soldiers. He yelled at them, saying to come and kill him. The soldiers mumbled that Cheng Dalei was coming, while someone ordered for the spearmen to advance and surround him. Another command arrived to shoot the arrows as the city lord gave orders that if they killed Cheng Dalei, they would get a high position with high pay and bring honor to their ancestors. However, Cheng Dalei charged at them without stopping, and the soldiers muttered that it was not good as their leader had been beheaded. Cheng Dalei leaped towards a group of soldiers, making his way into a narrow road, while the soldiers yelled to go after him as he was breaking out, while the others were ordered to send the signals and chase him and shoot the arrows. A fireworks exploded in the sky, making the soldiers across the mountain notice as they believed that they had found the target over that area. Another soldier said to the others to leave some men to block the road. A voice added telling the third army to hurry and head over there. While escaping, a soldier told his men to listen to the order, the 5th army troops should go around the forest valley ahead to intercept Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei held onto his horse tightly as he was getting away from the soldiers. Cheng Dalei ran wildly, breaking out of the siege and led the pursuers to the west and fled to a mountain forest. His horse huffed in exhaustion and moments later, its movement began to be so clumsy, making Cheng Dalei fall to the ground. Cheng Dalei kneeled down as he mumbled to his horse that he had been running wild for several days and it hadn't been easy for him to hold up till now. 
as he patted his horse, Cheng Dalei said that he'd better run for his life, to which the horse neighed. Cheng Dalei stood up and walked forward, mumbling that if he didn't die, they would meet again, leaving his horse behind. The horse whinnied loudly. Cheng Dalei, without looking back, moved forward. 30,000 officers and soldiers surrounded the mountain only to kill one person. Perhaps this would become a one and only unique history of the empire. Meanwhile, an officer ordered his men to search carefully and thoroughly and not miss a single tree or rock, while one notified the soldiers to narrow the area and set up roadblocks not to let him break out. A report came, bearing that General Hua's body had been found, and the entire squad he was leading was killed. Yang Longting's eyes widened as he was in disbelief about General Hua's death and also wondered how they were all killed when he had dozens of men under him. The report continued that all of them were slaughtered and cut in the throat with a sword, and everyone was killed by a single sword. One officer added that Lei Zhen of Yuzhu, Zhang Lemon of Fallen Leaves City, Han Bao of Red Sand, Dong Fingmeng of Bizen, and Sun Lianchen of Iron River were all dead, claiming that Cheng Dalei was actually good. While another one of the officers also said that those were the strongest people of all cities, the Ring tribe failed to kill them, but they died under Cheng Dalei's sword. Another man also believed that Cheng Dalei's strength was not weak if he could wipe out 100,000 cavalry of the Ring tribe in one fell swoop, while the other suggested that they stop sending more people, as it's just asking their men to die, while the other said that they should continue to surround the mountain until Cheng Dalei forces out to show himself, and they'll shoot a million arrows at him as he would certainly die. Enraged, Yang Longting slammed his hands on the table as he cursed. With a look of irritation he told all of the men under him that Cheng Dalei is all alone now and told them that they're a bunch of losers. He ordered all the soldiers to go into the mountains and surround him, as he didn't believe he could grow wings and fly, to which the soldiers obliged. Meanwhile at the mountain, an officer commanded his men to go up the hills and search well, not leaving their groups. After searching the mountain for seven days, Cheng Dalei was finally forced out. A sword clashed, as Cheng Dalei fought a soldier while his hand was pierced with an arrow, he managed to cut two soldiers. Quite a few blood splattered from one soldier. The men were in shock as they couldn't believe that he also killed General Liu Tu, while the other said that another one was also killed. Wounded and exhausted, Cheng Dalei knelt down holding his axe to balance himself while on his other hand was his sword. On the edge of death, one soldier told him that he already had no way out. As the soldier continued saying that resistance is futile, promising that they would keep his whole body intact if he finished himself. Cheng Dalei spoke, questioning them if he had no way out. He rose and told the soldiers who were pointing arrows at him if they had heard of a kind of superb martial art called the Phoenix Colorful Body Flying Without Wings. As he spread his arms like one surrendering, he said that hearts were linked as one. And he mentioned the fusion skill system. A system notification popped up and warned him that fusion function was available but forced use would consume the system sprite's original power. After using it, the system genie would dissipate after a few days. After learning about the fusion, Cheng Dalei asked to cancel the fusion. However, the system called Cheng Dalei while a warning kept intensifying. She told him not to cancel the fusion and said that if he had used his fuses earlier, he would have been able to escape long ago. He wouldn't have to wait until this desperate situation to use it, and she wondered what he was hesitating for. All was falling, Cheng Dalei answered, believing that she would disappear if he had used it. An officer ordered the killing of Cheng Dalei. Part continued, saying that if it weren't for him, she wouldn't have been born and if he died, she would also disappear from the world. She told him to take it, as it was her last source of strength, making Cheng Dalei glow in bright light. Cheng Dalei apologized to her in his thoughts. Hart said that when she's gone, he doesn't have to worry and should reset the system quickly, and at that time, a new system sprite will be born. She continued that maybe the new sprite would understand him better than she did. The soldiers above the cliff were ordered to release their arrows. As a barrage of arrows fell down, hitting Cheng Dalei, Hart bid her farewell to him. The fusion skill system spirit was capable of trampling the world of martial arts. Using Phoenix flying without wings was just like dancing in the sky. As Cheng Dalei was dodging the arrows, he stepped lightly on a passing bird. Confused, the bird as some of its feathers fell. Rumor had it that mountain bandit Cheng Dalei had jumped into the 10,000 feet cliff while walking on the wind in the rain of arrows. 30,000 soldiers searched for his body for 10 consecutive days, but no trace of him was found. Hart was in hibernation, and the system kept beeping. The lottery machine greeted his good sister. He asked her what was so good about Cheng Dalei, and she got herself in a situation because of him. The lottery machine mumbled a. Meanwhile, the rain fell as Cheng Dalei took shelter under some tree. 
However, as the rain still hit him, he kept reminiscing about his time with Hart. He looked up with a serious look on his face. Suddenly, the lottery machine appeared, calling for him. He asked Cheng Dalei if he thought about it, if he wanted a system reset. The lottery machine informed him that Hart would disappear soon, and after he reset the system, there might be a better looking little sister born, though it would not be Hart. And because of her disappearance after the reset, the tens of millions of fear points could also be retained. He repeated that it's tens of millions. The lottery machine continued asking him if he knew how many things he could smoke with just a single click of the button. Irritated, Cheng Dale spoke and told the lottery machine not to mention that matter, and if he gave up on Hart like this, he wondered if his conscience would allow him not to feel sorry about her. He asked the lottery machine if there was a way to save Hart. The lottery machine hummed and told Cheng Dale that he had a way. He informed him that if he first reset the power used to maintain the system sprite, he could let her survive for a while, and before the power was used up, he needed to find the container as soon as possible, and that it's a container that has residual power. The container can not only store Hart, he could also use the residual power above to reset the system. Most systems function, and heart could be restored just like before. He continued that if he still hadn't found the right container until the power ran out, the system would backfire and absorb his life force, informing him that he would die. Cheng Dale said that he can now start as he understood. The lottery machine informed him that before the system resets, Hart is still so weak that he couldn't use any functions. A notification popped up stating that due to system insufficient energy, the main system reset function is off, and all functions are off, and energy consumption is adjusted to the minimum. Cheng Dale asked how much time he had. Another system message appears stating that the remaining energy has been regulated to maintain the system sprites, and the dissipation time is extended to one year. The lottery machine answered that he has about a year, to which Cheng Dale replied good. The lottery machine said his goodbye to Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale began to walk. In order to save the heart on the verge of dissipating, Cheng Dale embarked on a new journey. Meanwhile at Fallen Leaf City, a huge amount of people entered its city gates. A voice said to a man that his reward was already arrived. He continued that he had no need to dwell on such things like jewels, weapons, gold, silver, army provisions, etc. as a first-class count was a powerful title. He had to go to the capital someday, and Emperor Ming would personally reward him. Fang Boshin smiled and said that although his reward was not as good as the one Yang Longting got, it's at least better than other city lords. He chuckled and mumbled that he finally came back, as he no longer had any need to depend on others and better went home. Fang Boshin believed that people's lives were really unpredictable as he imagined himself fleeing a mess back and never thought of today. After a while, at the city square, Fang Boshin stood in front of a huge group of people and called for his fellow townsmen. He told them that those ring tribes were coming to kill them, rob them of their food, and humiliate their wives and daughters, and that the only thing they could do was fight the ring tribe to the end, telling them that if they didn't protect them, who would if they weren't easy to bully, and that their fields, family, and the individuals they wished to protect were all unprotected. As he held his sword high, Fang Boshin said that now that the capital was calling for troops, good men should join the military and defend their country, and if they had the guts to come under his command. Fang Boshin smiled as he said that the capital also needed new palace maids, and asked the people if they wanted to soar and fly up to the tip of a branch. It was a rare opportunity. He also said that the younger the better as they wanted those energetic young people. Suddenly, a rock was thrown and hit Fang Boshin in the face, leading one of his teeth to fall. As his cheeks swelled, he asked angrily who threw that. Then a lot of objects were thrown as the people threw them and cursed at Fang Boshin. Wounded, Fang Boshin mumbled they're all rebellious people. He ordered his soldiers to kill all those unruly people. The crowd was like boiling water, and their anger was boiling underneath. When the ring tribe came, they hid in the cellars, in the barren mountains, in the gutters. They watched their loved ones being killed and their wives and daughters being humiliated. They couldn't find any of the noble people they worshipped. They remembered who protected them and those who abandoned them. On a certain day of a certain month in a certain year, the rebellious people surrounded and killed Fang Boshin. And as days passed, a lot more things happened in the empire. The next year, Emperor Ming decided to hold a martial arts competition at the beginning of the spring ancestral ceremony, and announced it to the world. Jizhu, Yanzhou, Qingzhu, Zazhu, etc. issued a wanted poster for the traitor Cheng Dale, and the rewards were very high. The body of the executed Lin Wenchen was transported back to the northwest border, and the townspeople were rewarded with food and drinks for 10 miles, with 10,000 people crying. 
His son, Lin Xiaoyu, knelt down for 10 days in front of the tomb and left home with his uncle without knowing where he was. In Jiangnan of the Yangtze River, a certain merchant group suddenly rose up. Its founders were a pair of beautiful sisters. It is also rumored that Cheng Dale was in Jiangnan. There are rumors that there were suddenly more bandits around the capital. And what is more puzzling is that there were so many mountain bandits, but they didn't fight for the territory. Rumor has it that Princess Mingyu returned to the capital, and the emperor was pleased and issued an imperial edict to find the trace of the sixth prince. Rumor has it that a strange bulger appeared in Jingzhu. And rumor has it that the Queen of Flowers was threatened by a big official, and was rescued by a man. Rumor has it that a certain thing of the previous emperor in the royal tomb was stolen. And a lot of rumors still spread. Time flew by in the blink of an eye and it was already half a year. Ten miles away from Jing City, a group of people traversed the mountain, as a man asked if they were almost at Jin City yet. Another man answered that he was correct, and asked him if he was going there to take the test. The bald man agreed and said that since the imperial court had announced that they were holding a martial arts tournament, every martial artist had been rushing to Jing City as the way there had been very lively. At the roadside, a tea stall. The owner told his guests that the tea and meat dish they had ordered was here. He asked Zhu Shenji and his group if they were also rushing to Jing City to take the test. Zhu Shenji chuckled and responded that it was obvious that he was heading there with his eldest son. The owner was in disbelief and said that looking at Kin Man's build, he was sure he could become a centurion at least. Kin Man listened, as the owner said that if he were a few years younger, he would have joined the test himself even if he had to sacrifice his old bones. He would still take down a few ring tribe generals with him. The other customer chimed in telling the old man to stop bragging, and if the Ring tribe were so easy to kill, why would the great generals back lose all their battles, getting beaten all the way to the imperial capital? While the man beside him said that it's just a shame that there's no one in the empire who's able to stop the Ring tribe. As the owner poured water, he asked them who said that there's no one as they have Yang Longting. In a single battle he killed over 10,000 enemies, helping all of the empire vent its anger. The customers agreed and said that if they could meet the war god this time and learn a few moves from him, they would be set for life. While the others questioned who doesn't want to learn from the war god and wondered if it's easy to meet that kind of figure, they might be able to get a look at the war god when the imperial court awards him. Zhu Linger who was holding her cup listened to a customer who said that if only their empire was filled with great generals like Yang Longting, the Ring tribe wouldn't dare to bully them anymore. Zhu Linger pouted and scoffed. The customers who noticed her expression pointed at her telling her what she meant by that, and how dare she disrespect the war god, asking her if she does not know gratitude. While the other scolded the man and said that he shouldn't argue with her as the girl is still young, so she hasn't seen the world yet. Zhu Linger, with her hands crossed, cursed at the customers, asking them why she would respect him as their war god was just a stray dog, which made the people mad. Zhu Shenji calmed them down, asking them to please calm down and that his daughter was not good with words and had offended everybody. He asked Zhu Linger what she meant by dog shit as it was not something a lady like her should be saying. However, Zhu Linger just scoffed at him. Zhu Shenji placed his payment for the food on the table and asked everyone if they could forgive his child as she didn't know what she was talking about. He told them that they would be taking their leave first, as the customers responded for them to get lost. On Chang'an, the official road, Zhu Linger believed that Cheng Dale was already dead as they had been looking everywhere and still hadn't found him yet. However, Zhu Shenji said that one year ago, while Cheng Dale was forced to jump off a cliff, the officials never found his body. He had a gut feeling that Cheng Dale was still alive, but he just didn't know how to find him. Kin Man chimed in and said that for this time's imperial martial exam, all the empire's martial artists would be attending it. He believed that Cheng Dale would definitely be there. Plus, the one surnamed Yang was there too. Zhu Shenji responded that after the Toad Village fell, he claimed that many of their brothers had turned homeless, forced to wander the lands, and it was all caused by Yang Longting. Not only that, Yang Longting even stole the fruits of their effort and is now hailed as the War God. He continued that the Toad Village did not need the glory, nor did it need the rewards, but they would not be easily taken advantage of. Otherwise, the brothers who died in battle would not have a peaceful death. As all of the survivors from the Toad Village bore a grudge against Yang Longting, it's just that it's hard to kill him while he is hiding in the city. But this time, they would have an opportunity. Kin Man believed that Cheng Dale would come to Jing City if he was alive. And if Lin Xiaoyu and Ling Chong were alive, they would also be in Jing City. He also believed that the four brothers Liu Bei, Guan Yu, Zhao Zilong, and Zhang Fei would also be there. And as of today, as long as the brothers were alive, they would meet them there. 
at Chang'an Imperial Capital, Jing City. Meanwhile, at an inn, a voice asked if they had found anything. Zhu Shenji said that there were two major events in Chang'an recently. The first was the martial arts examination, and the second was Yang Longting coming over, as he was sure that there was no need to elaborate. He continued saying that he also heard another thing, that the Ring Tribe's Hedden Battalion was coming over to take away the Imperial Princess. And another thing was that the sixth Imperial Prince had been missing since a year ago, as his current whereabouts were currently unknown. Kin Man added that he also heard something while looking around the market, that there were 1,000 plus bandits residing on the Hulu Mountain near the east side of the city. The army tried to take them down a few times but failed every time. Kin Man believed that they might have been their missing brothers. Zhu Linger also pointed out that she found out that the biggest brothel in Chang'an was the Full Fragrant House, and that the most popular courtesan was called Yi Jidao, as Yi Jidao did not entertain guests, and there were numerous people who would spend thousands of gold and still failed to see her. She continued that for the martial examination this time, Yi Jidao had already announced that whoever won the tournament could have her. Zhu Shenji blushed as he rubbed his beard as he mumbled Yi Jidao's name. Kin Man told him that he did not think his body was capable of that anymore. Zhu Shenji retorted and said that he was still completely healthy. He told them that he was just wondering whether it had something to do with Cheng Dale. Kin Man asked him how it could be related to him. Zhu Shenji chuckled and told Kin Man that it was nothing. He pointed at Zhu Linger and asked her how she had been able to find out about the news on the full fragrant house. Zhu Linger told him that she had gone in and pretended to sell flowers as they had let her in. Zhu Shenji said how could a little girl like her go into a place like that? As she recalled her time at the house, she informed Zhu Shenji that all the big sisters there were very talented and kind. She wanted to stay there longer and asked why she couldn't go there. Zhu Shenji's face darkened as she asked him if he also went there often. Stuttering, Zhu Shenji answered that when he went there, it was for work because she wouldn't understand even if he told her. Zhu Shenji said that there were still many things in Chang'an, and they should look around for more news tomorrow. If there was nothing, they would head to the Hulu Mountain. Zhu Linger asked if Cheng Dale would be in Hulu Mountain. Kin Man believed that he should be there, as he would never forget his true nature. Meanwhile, Zhu Shenji overheard the conversation at the other table, stating that to enter the Imperial residence like that, the toad was very impressive. The three of them quickly realized the word toad. The man couldn't believe that the Imperial residence was full of experts as they didn't detect even a single intruder, while the other man beside him said, what was the use of such an expert? At that time, even the Imperial army was sent out to search the entire place, yet they couldn't find a single trace of the intruder. Then suddenly, someone interrupted them, asking what they were talking about. The man turned and said that he was talking about the great master that broke into the Imperial residence, the Flying Toad. Smiling, Zhu Shenji asked the man if he could tell more about the matter. While the other man poured a drink into Zhu Shenji's cup, he asked him if he was new in Chang. As the Flying Toad was a great and famous expert, he stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Plus, he only targeted the corrupt and evil tycoons. The other man beside him said that he also liked to steal a bunch of antiques, and sometimes, he would even return them the day after he stole them. And rumors said that the Flying Toad wasn't a normal person, as he was born with a pair of wings and could fly in the sky. That's why he was called the Flying Toad. While the other man added that he also thought so, and if he could escape from the Imperial residence while being pursued by the army, he must definitely not have been a normal person. The man added that he would even deliver a paper with a drawing of a toad, telling the exact time he would rob before he committed the act. He did it many times already, and he never missed out on the timing. Zhu Shenji asked them if he had done anything recently. The man informed him that three days ago, the Zhuling Palace received a paper saying that the Flying Toad would be taking the antiques from their palace at a quarter before midnight. Zhu Shenji laughed as he said that great experts indeed were great experts. The way they did things was really different from their normal folds. Zhu Linger thought that the way the Flying Toad did things was very similar to how Cheng Dale did things. Kin Man clasped both of his hands as he asked the men where the Zhuling Palace was. Night came, as the three of them ran in the streets of Chang'an. Kin Man told Zhu Shenji that they were almost there, sweating. Zhu Shenji agreed and said not to be too flashy or else he'll scare Cheng Dale away. Zhu Linger added that they still didn't know if it was Cheng Dale. Zhu Shenji believed that it might have been, as he had a feeling that Cheng Dale was in the city right at that moment. Kin Man told them to be quiet, as the Juling Palace was right ahead. He asked them if they wanted everyone to know they were there. They arrived, and a huge group of people gathered. Exhausted, Zhu Shenji asked Kin Man if they had arrived, to which he received no answer. The crowd enthusiastically sold some food while others promoted their businesses. Kin Man and the others' faces darkened from what they saw. 
Qin Man asked if they had taken a wrong turn, as Zhu Shenji said that there were so many people. Zhu Ling'er suggested they go home and take a nap first, maybe the world would return to normal. Believing they had walked into some weird illusion, Qin Man asked one of the men what everyone was doing there. The old man believed that he must not have been from Chang'an as he didn't know. He informed him that it was to watch the great expert Flying Toad. Zhu Shenji asked him if the Flying Toad was a thief. The old man said that if he was a thief, thieves also had fans, and also that's why he didn't like foreigners. They didn't have a single drop of culture in their bodies. Tin Man agreed and said it was their first time in Chang'an and asked for the man's guidance. The man said since he was so sincere to learn, he could reluctantly tell him. He informed them that in the past half a year, three people became famous in Chang'an. The first was the Flying Toad, the other one was the Full Fragrant House's Yi Jidao, and the last one was the Imperial Princess Minjiu. Zhu Shenji asked the man if the army came. Would the Flying Toad not be able to escape as there were so many people surrounding the place? The man scoffed and rhetorically asked if the army wanted to catch the Great Flying Toad. He added that maybe in their next life. Suddenly, one man in the crowd yelled as he pointed to take a look over there that the Flying Toad was here. A masked man appeared on the top of the building. As he mumbled why bother hiding in the night, when dark clothes shine brighter than a pearl's glow. But when you step through the sky to find a path, you can escape from God's wrath, the flying toad said. Dozens of people cheered at the flying toad as Kin Man just stared at him. The flying toad stood up and said that he'd already obtained what he came here for today, as it was like hunting fish in a barrel. He came and went like the wind, robbed the rich, and helped the poor. He was the great hero of justice, as he posed in a weird way. He told them his name. Tin Man's face darkened and claimed that at his build he was nearly identical to Cheng Dale. Zhu Shenji added that his shamelessness was also identical to him. Tin Man believed that the change of Cheng Dale was a little extreme. Zhu Ling'er suggested that they just went back and took a nap, believing that everything would return to normal after they woke up. The crowd yelled that the soldiers were here, which made the flying toad on alert. He told them that he would be going first and told them that he loved them all. He laughed as he leaped from building to building. Zhu Shenji ordered Kin Man to go after the Flying Toad and said not to let him out of his sight, to which Kin Man agreed. The Flying Toad leaped from one building to another while Kin Man was chasing behind. Kin Man wondered since when Cheng Dale had such a beautiful lightning type ability. He claimed that he was almost like lightning in the dark. Kin Man was exhausted from all the running and cursed under his breath. He picked up a rock and thought that if he let him get away that day, it wouldn't be easy for him to find him again. As he was about to throw the rock, he told the flying toad to get down there and released it. The flying toad was hit from behind, which made a noise. He fell down to the ground and wondered where the stone came from. Behind him, Kin Man stood as he called for Cheng Dale. He knelt and asked the flying toad why he ran away when he saw them, which made the flying toad confused. Kin Man grabbed the mask and told the flying toad that he was wearing such a weird mask. As the mask came off, Kin Man was shocked. Zhu Shenji and Zhu Ling'er arrived asking Kin Man how the situation was and wondered if it's Cheng Dale. Kin Man told them to see it for themselves. Zhu Shenji and Zhu Ling'er didn't speak a word. The man behind the mask asked Kin Man to give him back his mask, as the flying toad never took his mask off. Zhu Shenji asked who the guy was. Zhu Ling'er grabbed the collar of the man and asked him to tell her why he was pretending to be the flying toad. The man asked Zhu Ling'er to calm down and asked her what she meant by pretending to be, as he really was the flying toad. Zhu Shenji tapped Zhu Ling'er's head and told her that it's alright. He said that they've been looking for Cheng Dale for most of the year, as it's like this every time. He sighed and told her that Cheng Dale might no longer be alive. Zhu Ling'er cried and said that it had been so hard for them to have hope. But every time it disappeared, and wondered where Cheng Dale was. Kin Man clenched his fist making the mask crumble and cursed. The man's face darkened as he saw his mask split. He asked the three of them what was going on and since they didn't want to take him for a reward, they didn't have to work so hard to catch him. He suggested that they're just going to pretend they didn't know each other without accusing each other of anything and asked them if he could go now. He also asked if he could have his mask back. The three of them gathered as Zhu Shenji asked what they should do with the kid. Kin Man said that since the man was injured by his throw, a lot of the work was already done by that, as he couldn't run anymore. Zhu Ling'er suggested that they should just hand him over to the government as there would also be a lot of silver as a reward, and that they didn't have money or an onward journey. Kin Man believed that the man's contact did not seem small and warned them of his revenge. As the man was listening, Kin Man said that he had noticed that they were looking for Cheng Dale, as there was no guarantee that he would keep the information to himself, maybe the government would find out about it. Zhu Shenji asked if they should just kill him. 
he suggested that they should cut off the man's tongue first so he couldn't scream around, and they would kill him and collect the bounty. Kin Man agreed and said that it was settled, which made the man sweat. The three of them smirked and Zhu Shenji said to the man to come as they were going to talk. Zhu Ling'er held a knife, while both Kin Man and Zhu Shenji held the men, telling him not to be afraid as it would be fine in a minute, while Kin Man told him to relax. Scared, the man told them to hold on. As he struggled, the man said to wait a minute, and asked them if they were looking for a person and that he could be of help. After a while, at an alley, the man complained about his back. Kin Man asked him if he could help them and if he knew who they were looking for. The man asked him if they were outsiders and if they didn't know the rules of Chang and City. As Zhu Ling'er held her knife, she asked him what's wrong with being an outsider, and also if an outsider had done anything bad to him. She threatened him that she would castrate him if he kept talking nonsense, to which the man didn't mutter a single word. Zhu Shenji hit Zhu Ling'er in the head and told her to watch her tone and that he should never have let her get that close to Zio Bai Lang. The man chuckled awkwardly and thought that Zhu Ling'er looked pretty cute but he didn't expect her to be so fierce. He asked them if they were bandits. Zhu Shenji asked him how he knew about that. The man asked another question about the area they were working in, whether it was the waterway, the dryway, or the Hulu Mountain. He thought it was obvious enough that a young girl dared to pick up a knife. Zhu Shenji asked the man if that was something he should be asking and told him to tell them about himself. The man agreed and informed them that they had just arrived in Chang'an City and might not know the current situation in Chang'an yet. He mentioned that the city of Chang'an was so big that finding one person was like looking for a needle in a haystack, but there was one person who could help them. Zhu Shenji asked the man, to which the man answered, Big Brother. Annoyed, Zhu Shenji told him that he didn't need to be so friendly and just said his thing. The man said that he was talking about the person who could help them was called Big Brother. He said that there were many people pretending to be Big Brother Chang'an, but there was only one real brother Chang'an. The man informed them that if they wanted to find someone, he might be able to help them. Kin Man asked the man if Big Brother was the big boss. The man continued that Chang'an had an underground city. Killers, thieves, bandits, fugitives, hidden prostitutes, and so on. These people were nestled in the underground city. And that Big Brother was the master of the underground city. He told them that if the underground city toll was 10 copper, the three copper coins would fall in the hands of Big Brother. And if the people inside got into trouble, Big Brother would not bother them as Big Brother was still a very righteous man. The man said that the underground city had all kinds of people, everyone had the most information and if they were looking for someone they could go to Big Brother, if he couldn't help you, no one in Chang'an City could help you. Sweating, Kin Man asked the man how they could meet him. The man giggled and told them that meeting Big Brother was not that easy. Ordinary people simply couldn't get into the underground city and seeing Big Brother was even more difficult, as he was not just someone they could see as they pleased. He suggested that they'd better find someone on the road that could introduce them to him as they would first sneak up in the underground city and get familiar with the people, and maybe he'll meet them if he was in a good mood. The three of them grinned, as Zhu Shenji said that they already found a reliable person who could help them. Confused, the man asked where that person was. The man realized that they were talking about him and asked them as he rejected. He told them that Big Brother would kill him if he knew that he was bringing outsiders to him. Zhu Ling'er told the man to take them to that man, as they didn't have time to talk to him or otherwise. The man should prepare to be a eunuch in his next life. Kin Man also said that if the man refused, there was no use in keeping his third foot, suggesting to break his hamstring. The man backed off towards a wall and told them he'll take them to the underground city right away. At Chang'an City Corner, Kin Man asked the man if there was a history of the underground city. The man answered that it was said that 30 years ago when Emperor Ming ascended to the throne, he built a tomb for his ancestors, but soon after the tomb was finished, the Ring tribe invaded and Emperor Ming escaped from Chang'an. And when he returned to Chang'an, he heard the Feng Shui masters say that it was the bad Feng Shui of the tomb that brought the Ring tribe. Emperor Ming believed those words, so the tomb was abandoned. And over the past 30 years, the pace gradually became the gathering of all sorts of people. As the man opened and picked up the stone, a stair was visible and told them that they had already arrived. He told them to follow him and not to run around. The man informed them that night was the busiest time in the underground city, and below them was the night market of the underground city, to which Zhu Shenji turned to look. He continued that the city's night market was a place for gambling, singing, selling stolen goods, and all kinds of business, and also hiring fighters, buying slaves, killers for revenge, and hidden prostitutes, a variety of stolen goods, a variety of rare treasures, and unseen things, as long as you had money you could buy anything in the underground city, the man said. 
As they climbed towards the stairs, two guards were guarding a huge door. The man told them not to talk nonsense in front of Big Brother. He informed them that Big Brother had a rule. If they wanted to ask him for help, they had to do something for him. Kin Man asked what it was. The man said that sometimes he would ask them their family heirloom, and sometimes he would ask to kill someone or steal a treasure, and also sometimes he would ask what you ate in the morning. The three didn't speak a word. The man greeted the guards and asked them if they had time as he has friends in Jonghu and they wanted to ask Big Brother for a favor. Axie spoke first and asked the man if he got the treasure that Big Brother asked him to steal, and if so he could put it and he can go. Aku added and told the man to go back, as Big Brother didn't want to see outsiders. The man looked at the three and told Axie and Aku if they could please tell Big Brother that his friend's business was very urgent. A voice inside the door spoke calling Axie and asked him what's with all the noise and ordered him to let them in. The door opened. Axie told them that the boss invited them inside. Inside, a female dancer greeted them as music played while she danced. As they entered, the man didn't speak a word. Moments later he bowed and greeted the boss. A hand appeared, asking Little Fei if he brought outsiders again to annoy him. Zhu Shenji stepped forward and said that they were new to the area and knew that he ran many things. He told him that they came to pay their respects to him. The boss showed his face as Zhu Shenji watched the man. Cheng Dalei turned to look at him as both of them didn't speak a word. He slapped his head and mumbled that he hadn't been a boss for years. As the woman continued singing, Cheng Dalei asked her that she could step back for now, to which Little Peach agreed. Zhu Shenji's tears fell as he said that they had finally found him and wondered if he wasn't dreaming. Cheng Dale answered that he was real and not fake at all, asking him not to pinch him as it hurts. As Zhu Shenji pinched Cheng Dale's face he said that he's really alive. Cheng Dale told Zhu Shenji to stop touching him as he already pinched him enough. Annoyed, Little Fei told them to stop and asked how they could be so rude towards Cheng Dale. Kin Man asked Cheng Dale where he had been for most of the year. Zhu Ling'er added that they searched hard for him. Cheng Dale smiled and said that he understood that they were looking for him and asked why he wasn't looking for them. He ordered Little Fei to go down to get some good wine, as today his friends arrived and no one would return sober, to which Little Fei agreed. Little Fei thought that it was the first time he saw Cheng Dale happy, believing that it seemed like they'd known each other for a long time. Moments later, they sat in front of the dining table. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale how he became like that. Cheng Dale sighed and said that it's a long story. He said that the day he fell off the cliff, if it hadn't been for a friend who helped him with his life, his soul would have already been in heaven. Although he just barely escaped, it took him a whole month to heal the injury, and since he was looking for something, he wandered on. But Cheng Dale's wanted list was everywhere, and he was afraid to show his face outside. But he still had some work to do, so he could not keep hiding in the mountains. He traveled far away from the Yuzhu area to explore the world in search of clues. So he sneaked secretly into the kingdom's top city, the Chang'an city. People like him, who couldn't just go out in public, hid in the underground city. The underground city was ruled by a boss before him, and when he first arrived, he naturally had a disadvantage and such. The guy rushed up to him and said, Young man, you are still young, the days are still long. Take out the precious things on your body and in the future you will work for me, as you are my subordinate from today onwards. Cheng Dale, at least, was once a village master who, of course, couldn't stand it. On the spot, he broke the guy's leg bone with a kick. Then he summoned dozens of thugs. After he knocked them all down one by one, Cheng Dale replaced him and became the new boss of the underground city. He still had some management experience and he applied the carrot and stick judiciously. If someone was in trouble in the underground city, he would help, if someone made a mistake, he would also punish them. And later, he started bribing the high-ups in the government. Thus, the underground city acquired a protective shield. So in just six months the place flourished. Everyone called him boss, as they felt a deep admiration because of that. In the underground hideout, Cheng Dale asked about the situation of the others. Shenji replied that Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei Bao brothers were still in the south of the Yangtze River, occupying the mountain as bandits. He sadly added that, for the others, who were departed a year ago, they never met them again. Cheng Dale sighed, expressing frustration at the chaotic state of the army and their lack of knowledge about their lost people. Kin Man remained optimistic and mentioned that this time, many of their people would join the martial arts examination. Cheng Dale also thought of the idea. He explained that he left a mark in the city to help their lost people find them. Curious, Kin Man inquired about the nature of this mark, admitting that he hadn't noticed it. Cheng Dale clarified that he set up tea stalls with toads painted on their banners outside every city gate. He questioned if they were not noticed when they passed by. 
A whimsical moment followed when Kin Man, Linger, and Shenji tried to recall the painted toad on the signage. Kin Man recalled what Shenji had said about that mark. Linger answered Kin Man, with her father's humorous comment about the fat puppy painted on the banner, while Shenji silently smiled. Cheng Dalei doubtfully said that there might be a reason why they could not find him. Suddenly, the young man burst in. He happily presented to Cheng Dale that he stole from the imperial kitchen, explaining that it was the 18-year-old apricot flower liquor, while pouring the liquor into Cheng Dale's cup. Shenji, perplexed by Fei Yuan, questioned Cheng Dale about him. Cheng Dale introduced Bai Fei Yuan to them. He shared the life of Fei Yuan. When he was young his parents died, got raised by an old ape in the mountain, saw a living person at the age of 12 and had no other skills so he became a burglar. He also shared the time Fei Yuan was caught by officials and saved by him. He told him that character disguise is important. Fei Yuan chimed in with a cheeky remark about Cheng Dale's life. Without him, there would be no flying toad today. Amidst their conversation, Jai Tao called Cheng Dale and explained that she knew that his friends were present, so she had taken the liberty to offer a toast of a cup of wine. She poured wine into her cup and drank it elegantly. While she drank Shenji flusteredly smiled at her while Linger and Kin Man looked at her without much reaction. After she drank the wine, Jai Tao then assured Cheng Dale that she wouldn't disturb him today while placing the cup on the table. She mentioned that whenever Cheng Dale wasn't feeling well, he could call on her. She was there for him, displaying graceful respect. Ji Tao included that she would wait for him. She said it with a hint of flirtation in her eyes. Cheng Dale acknowledged her offer and suggested she go back and practice the new song he had taught her. He asked her to sing it for him the next time they met. Shenji was curious and asked Cheng Dale about Jai Tao while he pervasively stared at her. With a proud expression, Cheng Dale remembered her name and asked Shenji if he knew about her. Linger, however, expressed her disinterest, remarking that Cheng Dale had fallen quite low. Cheng Dale defended himself, claiming his innocence. He then shared the story of how he helped Jai Tao. He explained that when a big shot person wanted Jai Tao's body, she was in a vulnerable situation and Jai Tao asked him for help. He couldn't bear to ignore a weak and lonely woman at that time, so he decided to assist her. Cheng Dale continued, saying that he taught her some songs, which she quickly learned, and it helped her rise to popularity, eventually becoming the first queen of flowers in the capital. Interested, Shenji couldn't help but emphasize Jai Tao's beauty, prompting bored reactions from Kin Man and Linger. Cheng Dale maintained his innocence but couldn't help but wear a sly grin, acknowledging Jai Tao's beauty in the situation. However, Linger mentioned the names Flying Toad and Jai Tao while expressing her suspicion. She then raised the question of whether Cheng Dale had any connection with Princess Minjiu, who was still missing, and whether Cheng Dale had a relationship with her. Cheng Dale calmly clarified that Princess Minjiu was actually Wanner, causing surprise among Shenji, Linger, and Kin Man. He wondered why they were looking at him in shock. The three of them went silent after hearing it. Axie interrupted their conversation with the news that a foreigner had arrived to visit him. He also reported that the foreigners had found their way through the tea stalls set up by their brothers at the city gates, suggesting that they might be the person Cheng Dale had been waiting for. In response, Cheng Dale gave the order to let them in. Liu Zhai expressed her unease about the eerie atmosphere. After they got inside, Liu Zhai questioned whether Cheng Dale was really present. As the both of them walked through the room, Cheng Dale and Su Ying locked eyes, and they both fell silent. Su Ying appeared surprised. Cheng Dale greeted them with a smile, remarking that it had been a long time since they had last met. On the other hand, Liu Zhai couldn't contain her excitement and rushed to hug Cheng Dale with joy, embracing him tightly. At the same place in the underground hideout, a man with a pleading expression was sharing his awkward situation with Cheng Dale. He began by describing Chang'an as a place where his ancestors had lived for generations. The man revealed that the restaurant he owned had been passed down from his grandfather to his father and eventually to him, having been in his hands for two decades. The man recounted a recent incident where the palace butler had visited his restaurant and ordered a roasted goose, a glass of floral wine, and four small dishes. He explained that the customer had consumed the entire glass of white wine and half of the roasted goose at his restaurant. After consuming the wine and half of the roasted goose, the butler fell ill at home and blamed the restaurant's food, demanding 1,000 silver coins as compensation. He also explained that the recipe for roasted goose had been passed down through generations in his family, and their restaurant was well known in Chang'an. He mentioned that there had never been any complaints about their roasted goose in the past. However, when he complained to the government about the customer's demand for compensation, they confiscated his store. 
he felt humiliated as he stood helplessly in front of his restaurant, with people from the palace laughing at him. Desperate for help, he explained that he had asked around, and everyone suggested that Cheng Dale was the only person who could help him. Cheng Dale questioned why the man had initially approached the government instead of seeking his help. The man, with desperation in his eyes, entreated Cheng Dale for assistance, seeking his help to teach a lesson to the corrupt officials. Cheng Dale, maintaining a stern expression, initially declined the man's request. The desperate man offered money, willing to pay any amount to secure Cheng Dale's assistance, emphasizing that Cheng Dale was his last hope in the entire city of Chang'an. Unmoved by the financial offer, Cheng Dale pointed out that the people in Chang'an ate his roasted goose, but he had never tasted it. He then expressed his disappointment that the man had approached him today for help without even bringing him a two-roasted goose. The man quickly made excuses for not bringing the roasted goose, citing that he was in a hurry and emphasizing his urgency in seeking justice. Cheng Dale, however, did not buy his excuse and instead reminded him how he was disrespected. He treated him like a tyrant, a murderer, and even brought silver to ask Cheng Dale to kill someone. The man was without a response to him while gritting his teeth. Cheng Dale understood his predicament. He then mentioned that the man started his restaurant with the hope of making money and believed that the law and government would protect his interests. Cheng Dale continued, revealing that the man never sought his friendship, causing the man to leave searching for a response, unable to find a reason. He highlighted that the man only sought help to get his right when he had no other choice left, and noted that throughout their conversation, the man failed to address him as boss. In response, the man stuttered, while hesitantly addressing Cheng Dale. He bowed to him as a sign of respect. Cheng Dale accepted this token of respect, remarking positively. As he approached the kneeling man, Cheng Dale agreed to help the man seek justice, expressing a desire for mutual assistance in the future should he ever find himself in trouble. But he expressed hope that the man would be there to help him if he got into trouble someday. The man was visibly nervous, acknowledging Cheng Dale's request for reciprocal support. On the other side of the room, Kin Man, Shenji, and Linger observed the situation. They were all stunned and speechless. Fei Yun then chimed in, conveying Cheng Dale's belief that a person's image held significant importance and he said it with a proud expression. After that moment, in the Chamber of Commerce of Su, the inn where they were staying, Su Ying confronted Cheng Dale. She began by noting that a few months ago, Cheng Dale had come to the south side of the river but had not shown himself, leaving only a message. Su Ying mentioned that Cheng Dale had tasked her with collecting the relics of kings and generals, which she had now brought. She asked if there was anything specific he wanted. Su Ying expressed her concern about Cheng Dale's busy schedule over the past few months, wondering if he had become so occupied that he couldn't find time to visit them. Cheng Dale explained that his underground men had also received orders to steal treasures from wealthy nobles, except for the royal treasury and the royal tombs. They had searched every noble family once. He believed they would find the treasure soon. Su Ying acknowledged the hardships Cheng Dale had faced while on the run. She then advised him to find a woman to take care of him for things that men couldn't do. She then mentioned that she lived with Liu Jai these days, and during the months Cheng Dale was absent, Liu Jai occasionally cried secretly at night. Su Ying suggested that Cheng Dale considered taking Liu Jai to his room, and told him that Liu Jai was attached to him for a long time. Furthermore, Su Ying mentioned that Xiaoda was her personal maid and was grown up. She proposed that Cheng Dale could take her as a maid to have an additional person to take care of him and to ease her concerns about Xiaoda's future. Xiaoda approached with a tray of tea, inadvertently overhearing Su Ying and Cheng Dale's conversation. Her reaction suddenly became awkward while approaching them. While Cheng Dale was busy looking at the relics, he expressed that he had more pressing matters to do in Chang'an City and didn't have the time for something like this. To which Su Ying responded with a momentary silence before agreeing. She fell silent again and displayed a demure expression before eventually speaking up. Su Ying then asked about the matter concerning Jai Tao, which seemed to stir a noticeable reaction in Cheng Dale. Su Ying voiced out her concerns, highlighting that she wasn't a jealous woman, yet she questioned Cheng Dale for not visiting them for months. She asked what he was doing with Jai Tao and Chang'an, expressing concern about what people might think of them. Her face turned red as she expressed her concern. Cheng Dale, with a slight tremor in his voice, nervously reassured Su Ying that he and Jai Tao and Chang'an were innocent and told Su Ying not to listen to other people's nonsense. Su Ying responded with a subtle smile and let out a small chuckle. She continued, acknowledging that she believed Cheng Dale and Jai Tao had not done anything wrong. She blushed while mentioning the way Jai Tao looked at Cheng Dale, implying that it seemed like Jai Tao had feelings for him. 
As she stood up from her seat, Su Ying offered guidance, urging Cheng Dalei not to mislead people and suggesting that he should resolve the matter before it became a problem. She expressed her coldness as to whether Cheng Dalei chose to accept or end his relationship with Jai Tao. Su Ying then noted that it was getting late and mentioned she was going back to her bedroom. Blushing, she suggested that Cheng Dalei should come over to get some rest once he was done working. Cheng Dalei remained motionless, his expression frozen, seemingly lost in contemplation about the complexities of a woman's heart, noting that it was like a shallow needle in the sea. Midnight, Cheng Dalei continued to carefully examine the various pieces of jewels, relics, and other items scattered. He pondered silently, recognizing the authenticity of these treasures. He thanked Su Ying's clear-sighted skills, that most of them likely belonged to kings and princes. Cheng Dalei's thoughts, mentioning that he was searching for a suitable container for quite some time, and his frustration was visible. He wondered to himself whether it was truly hard to find a suitable container. Suddenly as he pondered his thought, he recognized the uniqueness of the treasure. As he picked up the treasure from the box, the system suddenly beeped, indicating that he had acquired the container. Cheng Dalei's face contorted in shock as he recognized the relic's name. Chosen Son of God, Emperor Guanwu, Liu Zhu. The system chimed in, establishing a link now that Cheng Dalei had obtained the container. It warned that the container had limited capacity, only suitable for storing the system's sprite. Another beep indicates that a decision had to be made to transfer the system sprite or not. Cheng Dalei agreed, and the system sprite was successfully transferred to the container. The system then announced that the system administrator, Zin, was offline. It presented to him the option to reset the system. But there was a catch, the container's age had caused most of its power to escape, and it could only be used as a tank for the system's spirit. A further warning followed, stating that if Cheng Dalei wanted to reset the system, he would need to find a container with enough power. The system suddenly cautioned that the current power level was insufficient for a successful reset. In the underground world, Aku approached Cheng Dalei with updates. He informed Cheng Dalei that the Jiang Palace was lost in Night Glow Pearl, and couldn't find it after searching everywhere. They were now seeking their help in finding the pearl. Cheng Dalei while lying on his bed responded, and instructed Aku to bring the person responsible for the pearl's mission to Xiao Fei, who possessed the pearl. Cheng Dalei emphasized the need for caution and to avoid Xiao Fei falling into a trap, which Aku acknowledged the orders. Next, Aku brought up a conflict between the Black Fox Gang and the Iron Burden Gang over territorial disputes. He sought guidance on how to deal with the matter. Cheng Dalei responded with an insult, Questioning if they were beggars, expressed surprise that cultured people resorted to violence, and instructed Aku to tell them to split the territory in half with no violence allowed. Aku once again acknowledged the orders. Aku then reported another situation in which the Shenwu escort team had been robbed by Hulu Mountain while escorting an item. They were requesting their help to recover it. Cheng Dalei expressed his lack of interest in helping the Shenwu escort team recover their stolen goods suggesting that if they had failed to pay tribute to Hulu Mountain, they should learn a lesson and suffer a little. He seemed unwilling to assist them, to which Aku agreed. Aku then mentioned another report that the leader of a troop, whom Cheng Dalei had previously saved from jail, wanted to meet him and personally express gratitude. Aku inquired if Cheng Dalei wanted to see him. Cheng Dalei appeared curious as he stood by his bedside and sat down, asking if it was a good idea to meet him. Aku mentioned that the leader of the troop Cheng Dalei had rescued was a male, which led to Cheng Dalei's response to Aku to tell them to get lost and not to bother him. Aku nodded and acknowledged Cheng Dalei's decision. Just as the conversation was concluding, Fei Yuan entered the room with news from the Imperial residence, specifically about an event scheduled for tomorrow afternoon at Chang'an's wine house. Later in Chang'an city, Shenji couldn't help but question Cheng Dalei's if he put on makeup when he went out. Cheng Dalei sighed and explained that he had to wear a disguise when he went out because his wanted posters were plastered all over Chang'an. Without a disguise, he would essentially be a walking pile of silver. Curious about Cheng Dalei's future plans, Shenji asked if he intended to remain in Chang'an or if he would seek another mountain to rule over and find their missing brothers. Cheng Dalei expressed his opinion that despite the appeal of Chang'an, there were too many laws in the city compared to ruling over an entire mountain. However, he mentioned that he had some things to do in Chang'an, prompting Shenji to confirm and change the topic by asking who they were going to meet next. Cheng Dalei responded that they were going to meet the boss. Shenji was surprised and asked him if there was still someone higher up than him, to which Cheng Dalei revealed that there was indeed a boss above him in Chang'an and emphasized the importance of having someone to rely on in Chang'an. As they arrived at Chang'an Wine House, someone poured tea into a cup. 
Wan Er asked Cheng Dalei why he hadn't visited her in such a long time. Cheng Dalei responded, mentioning that he had been very busy with all the work she left for him as the chairman. Wan Er refuted his claim, questioned Cheng Dalei about his reference to a chairman, and clarified that she was only requesting his help with some errands and finding out some news, which shouldn't have been hard. She noted that it had been half a month and asked for the information she needed. Cheng Dalei playfully commented that even a single order from her had set hundreds of his men to start working to death. He then recalled her previous requests, like catching butterflies that he had run around in the mountains to catch a few hundred and acquiring a western bobcat that he had pulled so many of his connections just to buy one for her. Unfinished recounting the extravagant requests in the past by Wanner. Afterward, Cheng Dalei handed over a comprehensive manual on how to put on makeup, written by Zhai Tao. He also mentioned the list of the best street food, snack shops, and restaurants in Chang'an, all of which had been meticulously chosen by his men who had visited each shop. Having fulfilled her requests, Cheng Dalei asked for what he wanted. Wan Er handed Cheng Dalei an item that she had secretly taken from the Imperial Armory. She emphasized that he wasn't allowed to take it away. Cheng Dalei recognized the item Wan Er had shown him, stating that it was the founding Emperor Lai Manzi's long spear. As he finished examining the weapon, Cheng Dalei realized that the relic wasn't the key he had been searching for. He pondered the past story of the legend Lai Manzi with only his spear ending 19 years of war and creating the Great Dawu Empire but came to the conclusion that the key didn't lie with the weapon. Satisfied with his brief inspection, Cheng Dalei handed the weapon back to Wan Er, who was puzzled by his lack of interest asking Cheng Dalei if he didn't want to look at it further. She commented on his weird behavior, mentioning that all effort was just to take a single look to see her ancestor's prized weapon. He chuckled and explained that he admired ancient heroes and felt a sense of fulfillment in his heart upon seeing their legendary treasures. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei changed the topic by inquiring about the reason why she was looking for him, reminding her that they were in agreement in which he would run errands for her in exchange for taking a look at her family's treasures. Initially, Wanner couldn't utter a word because she hesitated in her request and her face turned red. But then she burst out the reason, asking Cheng Dalei to elope with her. She caught Cheng Dalei off guard with her unexpected request, while Shenji pondered the surprising turn of events in his thoughts. Cheng Dalei struggled to find the right words to respond to her unexpected proposal. Wanner continued, explaining that she didn't want to be married off by her father and that she wasn't ready for marriage yet, she explained while pouting. Cheng Dalei responded to Wanner's concerns, suggesting that it was common for someone of her age to be married. He asked about the prospective groom her father had in mind for her. Wanna revealed that her father planned to marry her to the top placer of the martial arts examination. Cheng Dalei thought this was a good thing, noting that in ancient times, beauty was often found alongside great heroes, while he gave a thumbs up and smiled widely. He expressed confidence that as the top placer among thousands, the person in question would become a great hero. But Wanner was upset, shouting at Cheng Dalei as she hit the table, causing the cup to tip over and spill the water. She irritably emphasized the complexity of the martial examination this time and asked him if he understood so-called inner court politics, to which Cheng Dalei asked Wanner to teach him about it. In response, Wanner pouted, as if she found it hard to believe him. However, Wanner still explained that the upcoming examination would not only assess martial arts but also troop formations, war strategy, and commanding ability. She mentioned that there were 3,600 spots allocated for representatives from cities across the empire, and each city would select talents to represent them in the examination this time. Cheng Dalei expressed his amazement at the size of the empire, noting that among the 3,600 chosen people, there were definitely plenty of experts. Wanner straightened up in her seat as she responded that there wouldn't be many experts, but rather a lot of nobles. She then asked Cheng Dalei if he knew how the representatives for the examination were chosen. Cheng Dalei speculated that the representatives would likely excel in both pen and sword, with local competitions choosing those who excelled the most who were then sent to the examination. However, Wanner made it sound as if she wasn't satisfied with his explanation. Cheng Dalei questioned Wanner, asking if she was implying that it was not like what he had described. Wanner explained that the imperial court was paying a lot of attention to the examination this time. She mentioned that even if the participants didn't win in the end, a good performance could still be viewed highly by the court. She continued to describe how the chances to participate in the examination were distributed. Some spots were quietly given to influential families, while others were auctioned off to the highest bidder. Shenji interjected, questioning whether this would turn the martial examination into a feast for the nobles. Cheng Dalei considered the implications of this new information. 
he realized that this examination could be more complicated than Wanner had initially thought. As he thought about the past, the Imperial Court only held academic exams and never martial ones, and it was an opportunity for people from Jiang Hu to showcase their skills and potentially rise in ranks. He considered the possibility that people from Jiang Hu might try to rob an official token from those coming to take the exam and use it to enter the test. Cheng Dalei contemplated that in this era without pictures, he could claim the name on the token as his own, and no one would be able to confirm if his name was truly Zhang Ma Zai or not. He mused on the idea that among the individuals who had already entered the exam, there might be a considerable number of bandits and murderers. Cheng Dale found the situation increasingly interesting. He let out a smirk. Cheng Dale chuckled despite the seriousness of the matter, which didn't sit well with Wanner. She questioned his laughter, clearly annoyed by his reaction. Cheng Dale brushed off his laughter by coughing and urged Wanner to continue with her explanation. Wanner emphasized that with the current level of conflict among the people, the competition for the top position was intense. Whoever secured it would command the border defense forces and receive land and authority from the court. She pointed out that the nobles, whether from scholarly or martial families, were fiercely competitive and all wanted the winner to be someone from their families. Wanner mentioned that the host of the examination was also from a noble family. Cheng Dale noted the conflict of interest where the organizers of the examination were acting both as referees and competitors in the competition. Wanner expressed her concern about how the examination would assess military strategies, as they couldn't engage in actual war with each other, but merely write it down on paper. She continued, stating that whoever they claimed to be unqualified, was unqualified. Cheng Dale expressed his understanding that the judges were already corrupt. He questioned whether her father was aware of the corruption surrounding the examination, and whether he was willing to let this mess continue. Wanner revealed that her father was aware of the situation and intended to marry her off to the top placer in order to establish a connection between the royal family. With a shallow expression, Cheng Dale commented on the emperor's ruthlessness. Wanner expressed her reluctance to become a political tool, and her desire not to be married to anyone, emphasizing that even if she were to marry someone, she passionately aspired to marry a great hero who led millions of elite soldiers under his command, much like the legendary war god Yang Longting, who repelled a hundred thousand ring tribesmen, her admiration evident in her expression. Wanner, with admiration and delighted eyes, mentioned the empire's god of war, Yang Longting, who was renowned for annihilating one hundred thousand enemies. However, Cheng Dale and Shenji couldn't help but hold back their laughter upon hearing her statement. Puzzled by their reactions, Wanner inquired about their amusement. Cheng Dale couldn't help but burst into laughter, playfully suggesting that Wanner read more books to enhance her aesthetics. Shenji cleared his throat as he stopped laughing. Wanner then continued her statement, expressing her expectation for Cheng Dale to help her now that he was considered one of her people. However, Cheng Dale hesitated, explaining that he couldn't leave Chang'an just yet as he had something to do. Wanner, somewhat disappointed, responded by saying she already suspected Cheng Dale was waiting for the Imperial examination results. She decided to make arrangements on her own and asked him to help her with something. Cheng Dale, displaying his determination, offered to ruin the martial arts examination if that was what Wanner needed. He was ready to gather his people and create chaos in Chang'an in 10 days to prevent the examination from succeeding. Unimpressed, Wanner told him to stop being so violent, that he was really a mountain bandit. Cheng Dale sought clarification from Wanner and requested that she specify what she needed him to do as he expressed his confusion. Wanner proposed a plan to Cheng Dale, explaining that it would allow him to participate in the martial arts examination and eliminate the things she found ugly and repulsive. However, Cheng Dale, however, expressed doubt, stating that he was just a mountain bandit and had no desire to win the martial arts examination to become a border guard for the empire. Weiner clarified her intentions, noting that she didn't want him to take the imperial examinations. Instead, she wanted him to be an examiner. Cheng Dale appeared hesitant and questioned how she was able to put him in the examination room. Wanner reassured him, revealing that she had already checked it. She explained that there were a hundred examiners this time representing various factions, but one individual didn't belong to any faction. Wanner continued, mentioning that no one in Chang'an had ever seen the person. She then revealed her plan, wanting Cheng Dale to disguise himself as that person and blend in. Prompting Cheng Dale to inquire about the identity of the person, Wanner disclosed that it was Northwest Yun Xiaoguan Guard General, Niu Sanjin. 
after their conversation 10 miles away from the official road to Chang'an. A couple was on their journey toward Chang'an, but the wife was growing impatient, asking her husband about their proximity to Chang'an and the urgency of their child's hunger. She implored him, urging him to pick up the pace. Anxiously, the wife raised the issue of their lengthy journey and questioned her husband whether they were heading the wrong way once more. The husband defended himself, explaining that he never was to Chang'an before and blamed Kan Chai for providing incorrect directions. Exasperated, the wife sighed and lamented her misfortune, expressing regret for following him. The husband attempted to reassure her, mentioning that their situation would improve once they arrived in Chang'an, where he was transferred by the imperial court. It revealed that the husband was Yun Shui Guan Guard General, New Sanjin. However, their journey was interrupted by Cheng Dalei and his group who ambushed them on the road and demanded toll fees or threatened to harm them. Cheng Dalei asserted his ownership of the mountain road and demanded all of their belongings as a toll fee for passage. He further issued a menacing threat, hinting at potential harm if his demands weren't met. Four of them were covered in masks. Sanjin's wife, taken aback by the sudden encounter with these apparent bandits, expressed her regret, implying that marrying Sanjin might have been a mistake. She even stood up from her seat in agitation. Although displaying a touch of fear in his expression, Sanjin attempted to reassure his wife, assuring her that he was there. Sanjin, with a resounding battle cry, unleashed his swords in a burst of anger. He boldly confronted Cheng Dalei's group, accusing them of being bandits who dared to rob an imperial military officer. He pointed his swords at Cheng Dalei's group, his fury evident. Cheng Dalei inquired if he indeed was New Sanjin. New Sanjin confirmed his identity as the guard general of Yun Shui Guan. Shenji chimed in with historical context, mentioning that hundreds of years ago, the ancestor Sanjin had gifted a horse to their great ancestors, which led to him being assigned to Yun Shui Guan. The duty had passed down through generations, and now it was in the hands of the fifth generation new Sanjin. Shenji continued, explaining that in the previous year, during a large-scale invasion by the Ring tribe, Yun Shui Guan hadn't lost a single soldier in the conflict, which had earned them recognition from the imperial court. Cheng Dalei made a humorous remark about Yun Shui Guan's poverty and limited number of soldiers. Shenji then mentioned that Emperor Ming appreciated the new family's dedication to guarding Yun Shui Guan for generations without asking for resources for many years, which was recognized as the backbone of the empire. Sanjin, after revealing his identity, displayed a confident demeanor and expressed his satisfaction after Cheng Dalei learned his name, suggesting that he should back off. Shenji added more context, explaining that the imperial court designated Sanjin as an examiner for the martial arts examination, emphasizing that Sanjin did not belong to any faction. Cheng Dalei called upon Kin Man, who promptly acknowledged the order and proceeded to engage in an attack, attempting to tie new Sanjin and his wife. In response, New Sanjin bravely faced the confrontational attack, challenging Kin Man and mentioning his technique, the whirlwind chopping autumn wind sword. As the battle raged on, New Sanjin emitted cries of pain, vocalizing his struggle to break free. Despite Sanjin's bruised face, Linger noted his square face, purple coloration, wide mouth, and long beard. She questioned his appearance, wondering if he truly matched the description, and questioned whether he was a bandit. Kin Man, with a satisfied smile, announced that he finished tying them up. He even placed his foot on Sanjin's back to assert control. His wife expressed regret for marrying him, and their son called out to his father. Sanjin, despite his injuries, emphatically questioned the audacity of anyone trying to impersonate him, asking what they wanted from him and pleading for the release of his wife and son. Cheng Dalei instructed Kin Man to take new Sanjin and his family to Hulu Mountain and hide them there, as he was done wearing Sanjin's armories. He also instructed Kin Man to return to the underground city and let Su Ying manage its affairs. Shenji and Ling'er pretended to be his old slave maids. With their plan in motion, they continued their journey, now approaching the city of Chang'an. At Chang'an Palace, Cheng Dalei was stopped by the eunuch. He held a portrait, inquiring if the representative Cheng Dalei was the real Sanjin. Cheng Dalei, who was disguised as Sanjin, affirmed that the portrait represented him. However, the eunuch remained skeptical, suggesting he looked nothing like the portrait, and questioned if Cheng Dalei was pretending to be someone else. Cheng Dalei calmly explained that he had been fat at the time. The eunuch continued to assert that the portrait did not resemble Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei, instead of insisting further, surprisingly agreed with the eunuch's assessment, acknowledging that the person in the portrait was indeed not him. The eunuch, somewhat puzzled, asked if Cheng Dalei was admitting to being an imposter. Cheng Dalei defended himself, proposing that the eunuch check the age of the portrait, 
revealing that it was his grandfather's likeness. He expressed disbelief that anyone would impersonate his grandfather, known as Nu. Chenji then intervened, clarifying that Sanjin had long since passed away, and Cheng Dale was his fifth-generation grandson. The eunuch, grasping the situation, acknowledged the changes that had occurred and mentioned the emperor's passing. He empathized and requested Cheng Dale's official seal for registration, which Shenji promptly handed over. As they proceeded inside, they attracted the attention of the people in the area, who were curious about the newcomers. A person from the civilian faction pointed to Cheng Dale and remarked that he was a complete stranger to them. Another member of the faction wondered when someone so poor had joined the ranks of the military officials. Someone in a mocking tone commented on the antiquity of Cheng Dale's armor, suggesting it might be older than his grandfather. Another civilian faction member chimed in, stating that Cheng Dale was from a remote place that didn't even know half the rule. Some in the civilian faction found it surprising that, despite his apparent poverty, the general had servants, which made Cheng Dale face irritable. Internally, Cheng Dale pondered the historical tension between military and civilian officials, wondering if these civilians assumed he was a newcomer. He then addressed the crowd directly, questioning their amusement. In response to the comments, Cheng Dale defended himself, stating that while his armor was worn, it had been passed down through generations in his new family. The civilian faction continued to mock Cheng Dale's appearance, questioning his origin and criticizing him for taking an exam without appearing well-groomed. Another member of the civilian faction made a reference to the importance of the temple and the reverence shown to the Son of God. Amidst the mockery from civilian factions, a member of the military faction also expressed their disapproval of the general's unkempt clothing, seeing it as a sign of disrespect to his majesty. Cheng Dale acknowledged the state of his old and worn armor, admitting that it no longer shone like the official uniforms. He explained that he couldn't afford new armor but would wear it in battle if the rings attacked following the tradition of his new family's ancestors. Members of the civilian faction commented on the importance of the examiners as representatives of the martial arts examination. They raised concerns about the general's appearance, suggesting that if everyone looked as unkempt as he did, it would invite ridicule from the world. Cheng Dale defended his choice to wear his worn armor, asking if there was any shame in it. He questioned whether the battles fought against the rings, the loyalty he displayed, or the glory of serving the emperor's soldiers were ridiculous. A member of the civilian faction was left speechless by his response, while another person in the group acknowledged Cheng Dale's eloquence talents. Cheng Dale, somewhat surprised by the comment, asked about this mention of eloquence. Cheng Dale passionately emphasized that imperial soldiers didn't defend the borders with arguments but rather relied on their worn armor, sturdy bodies, and unwavering determination. He criticized those in the group who merely engaged in empty talk, accusing them of deluding themselves when discussing generals in worn armor fighting against the rings. He continued passionately, questioning their intentions, wondering if they aimed to demoralize the dedicated soldiers who served their country. He warned against allowing the ring tribe to seize their beautiful land. In the wake of Cheng Dale's impassioned statements, the entire civilian faction fell into absolute silence, stunned by his words. Meanwhile, one member of the military faction engaged in whispered discussions, suggesting that Cheng Dale had a talent and suggest recommending him to headquarters, while the other, extending a friendly gesture to Cheng Dale, offered him a pair of armor, hoping he could accept it as a token of friendship. Cheng Dale clenched his fist as he acknowledged in his thoughts the utility of his eloquent skills. As the gathering continued, the host addressed the participants who had come from afar. The host went on to explain that before they took charge of the examinations, Emperor Ming would first conduct a written test on them. This would determine their level and position in the group of examiners. Continuing, the host clarified that the three with the best scores would serve as principal investigators. Together with His Majesty Emperor Ming, the last military leaders were selected, and that made both the civilian and military factions form shock on their faces. Inwardly, Cheng Dale admitted that written exams weren't his strong suit. Cheng Dale considered that he was running out of time to practice his brush writing skills, recognizing the importance of paper notes in the current era. He thought that the topic of military management struck him as quite broad. He observed the civilian officials who had recently faced a defeat and noted their eagerness for a fight, as they seemed determined to teach the military a lesson in this test. As he looked at the old military men, many of whom struggled with writing, he sensed their discomfort and embarrassment. Acknowledging his own role as a military officer, he couldn't help but feel that he was already putting on a show, and it might not have been right for him to make a spectacle of himself again. He pondered whether he should have simply submitted a blank answer sheet and gotten by with it. 
As he contemplated the situation, he began to doze off. However, his nap was interrupted when Wanner approached Cheng Dale's table and kicked him to wake him up. She disguised herself as eunuch. Cheng Dale, displaying irritation, looked up at her with tired eyes, while Wanner stared at him in anger. In a hushed voice, Cheng Dale asked her if there was a standard answer for the test. Wanner, on the other hand, stared intently at him. In response, Wanner snubbed him, and Cheng Dale stared at her in response. Cheng Dale thought to himself, realizing that Wanner wasn't there to help him cheat but to monitor whether he had the strength to work. Reflecting on the topic of military management, he considered it both simple and complex, understanding why these words were written by His Majesty Emperor Ming. He thought about the various aspects, from training a small team to controlling an army of a hundred thousand. He also considered the spiritual construction of imperial soldiers. Drawing from his own experience in leading thousands of men and handling troop deployment, logistical support, and medical care for the sick and wounded, he pondered how to effectively translate his knowledge onto paper. Finally, Cheng Dale decided to write the statement as a brief discussion of the spirit of the bright sword. Within the capital of Chang'an, individuals who took the exam discussed their experiences. One person said that the exam was quite challenging making it difficult to know where to start with the answers. Another individual agreed, mentioning the abundance of choices that made the questions particularly challenging to tackle. Wanner, with a smile, asked Cheng Dale about his answer to the exam. Cheng Dale responded confidently, stating that his answer was pretty good and simple, not difficult at all. Wanner questioned him further, asking what kind of score he expected to receive. He even boasted that he expected to receive a full score, which Wanner appeared taken aback by Cheng Dale's confidence. Cheng Dale continued to boast, claiming that if rankings were to be considered, he would easily secure the first position. Wanner, growing irritable, responded with a sigh and expressed skepticism about Cheng Dale's chances of surpassing the competition, emphasizing the complexity of the situation. In her thoughts, Wanner acknowledged that she might need to assist Cheng Dale herself. As night fell at the general's heavenly policy mansion, the general was filled with laughter and praised New Sanjin for speaking on behalf of the military officers. One of the military personnel recounted the situation to the general, describing the pale faces of the group of civilian officers when Cheng Dale confidently declared that he would secure first place in the test. The general appeared concerned about the possibility of Cheng Dale actually achieving the top position, as it might make the palace's academic people of the palace become laughingstock for them. The military person suggested that since Cheng Dale had no name or affiliation, they should try to bring him to their side. The general recognized Cheng Dale's talent and believed that inviting him to join the military faction would improve their chances of winning the martial arts examination. He also noted that he became rivals with an old man from the palace in this competition. Regarding the matter of imperial military power, the general emphasized the need to prevent interference from the palace and declared that the war scholar must ultimately be their man. One of the military personnel inquired if the general already had a candidate in mind, to which the general mentioned the name Liu Kingaming. At the residence of Magistrate Kui the following day, discussions were taking place. Magistrate Kui expressed his skepticism about Cheng Dale's ambition to claim the first position. He considered Cheng Dale nothing more than a clown and instructed his people to examine Cheng Dale's writing closely. Magistrate Kui emphasized the need for caution in the upcoming martial arts exam, as the old martial artist was not weak. He then presented their candidate's work and instructed that it be read and the list burned. The magistrate made it clear that their people were top positions on the list, and he specifically mentioned that Jiu Zhang was the top scholar this time, which the officer acknowledged his instructions and bowed. As evening fell at the residence of the martial arts examiners, there was a loud knock at the door. Cheng Dale responded to the noise, called out that he was coming. As he opened the door gate, he addressed Wanner, expressing concern that they might get caught. However, Wanner responded with a mischievous smile, seemingly untroubled by the potential risks. As Linner served them tea, she observed Wanner blankly. Wanner started talking to Cheng Dale, stated that she was there for an important matter and asked him if he remembered the mission she had given. Cheng Dale affirmed that he always kept it in mind. He understood that the mission involved eliminating those Wanner disliked and supporting those she favored to rise to the top. He inquired if she had specific individuals in mind. Wanner confirmed this, stating that even though she didn't know who she liked yet, she was sure about who she didn't like. She explained that there were two people she wanted Cheng Dale's help in getting rid of, prompting Cheng Dale asked to which two. Without hesitation, Wanner mentioned the names of Liu Kingaming and Ji Yu Zhang. Cheng Dale assured Wanner that he would complete the task and showed a big smile while giving a thumbs up. 
Curious about her choice of targets, Cheng Dale inquired why she had specifically chosen those two people. Wanner dismissed their abilities, describing one as a wimp and the other as a muscle freak, both lacking intelligence. She speculated that they might get disqualified on their own, which Cheng Dale found to be the best outcome. Wanner then reminded Cheng Dale about her request to help her find her sixth brother and asked if he had any news. Cheng Dale explained his inability to gather information since he couldn't even leave Chang'an. He pessimistically suggested that her brother was already dead. Wanner dismissed his statement, chiding him for making ominous remarks. The next day, the martial arts competition was coming up, and the two major groups, represented by the general and the ministers, were in the ring. They were ready to wrestle and tear each other apart and they did not know that it wasn't a face-to-face -face duel, as they thought. Somehow, an insignificant person had also entered the ring. He raised his eyes and looked around with confidence. Meanwhile, in the royal study room at the Waiyang Palace, an officer informed Emperor Ming that the examination papers for the written tests had been reviewed and were ready for his inspection. Emperor Ming hastily inquired about New Sanjin's writing, prompting the officer to explain that they had already excluded his paper due to its poor quality. The officer questioned why the emperor would want to read it. Emperor Ming revealed that he had heard about Wanner's claim that Cheng Dale would secure first place and wanted to see what he might have been hiding in his heart, as Cheng Dale had boasted that much. He then instructed the officer to bring Cheng Dale's writing, to which the officer acknowledged it. In the Waiyang Palace, Emperor Ming was reading Cheng Dale's writing, which discussed the spirit of the bright sword. The text described the mindset of a swordsman when facing an opponent, emphasizing that even if they knew they would lose, they would draw their sword and engage in combat. It emphasized that losing under the opponent's sword would still bring pride, embodying the spirit of the bright sword. Emperor Ming contemplated the article, noting that it didn't employ flowery language like civil officials, nor was it as cryptic as military officials. He found the writing style to be simple and easy to understand, though he remarked that the handwriting was a bit ugly. Continuing to read, Emperor Ming encountered the phrase, Facts prove that an army with fine traditions often had the soil to cultivate heroes. As Emperor Ming continued to read Cheng Dale's writing, he read the statement, Faith showed how powerful the spirit of an army was. Emperor Ming contemplated this and then read on, where the writing emphasized that with faith, they could protect the country, with pride, they could maintain peace, and with duty, they could uphold righteousness, embodying the spirit of the army. Emperor Ming expressed his approval, praising Cheng Dale for his strong allegiance to the country. His officers were surprised and somewhat disbelieving by the emperor's enthusiastic response. Emperor Ming decided to reward talented individuals and ordered that Cheng Dale be awarded first place in the examination. The officers were uncertain about how to respond, knowing that they accepted money from the civil factions, and they exchanged looks while bowing to the emperor. The officers expressed their concerns to Emperor Ming pointing out that although Cheng Dale's article was good, it might attract unwanted attention, especially from the Ring Tribe peace envoy who was due to arrive soon. They worried that the Ring Tribe negotiators might doubt the sincerity of their peace talks if they knew that Cheng Dale's article had been placed first. One of the officers emphasized the need to focus on regaining their strength after the war rather than showcasing the article on the bright sword. Emperor Ming considered their advice and decided not to alter Cheng Dale's ranking. Instead, he suggested that the article be copied and distributed among the army for study. However, he wanted the writing to be improved to make it less vulgar. The officers agreed to this plan. One of them mentioned the conflict between Cheng Dale and a civil official before the examination and speculated whether Cheng Dale could be a member of the general's family. Emperor Ming dismissed the officers, instructing them to leave. After the officers departed, another person within the palace approached Emperor Ming and expressed concern about Cheng Dale's origins, suggesting that the snake team investigate further. Emperor Ming decided against such an investigation, stating that as long as the balance of factions was maintained, he would allow them to do as they wanted. This person introduced as a monk acknowledged the emperor's decision. Emperor Ming inquired about any news regarding Xing Zai, and the monk reported that the crane team and the deer team had been dispatched. Some reports indicated that Xing Zai had been seen in Yangzhou, so there should be news soon. Emperor Ming expressed his thoughts about Xing Zai, showing a sense of sad expression. Meanwhile, in the northwest region of Yangzhou, Xing Zai, who appeared worn out and poorly dressed, walked in the middle of nowhere, using a cane due to exhaustion and hunger. Xing Zai expressed his desperation for a meal, listing various extravagant dishes like roast goose, roast sheep, and shark fin. 
He was so hungry that he couldn't be choosy. Suddenly, he spotted a snake in front of him, and his hunger-driven excitement led him to see it as a potential source of meat. As Zing Zai eyed the snake, another person also noticed it and expressed his desire for the meat, which surprisingly this person is food delay. A tense situation unfolded as both men wanted to claim ownership of the snake they had spotted. Their aggressive expressions and thoughts revealed their determination to secure the meal. As the battle for survival between Zing Zai and Fu Delay escalated, they resorted to physical combat. Fu Delay pinched Zing Zai's face, and Zing Zai defended himself by striking back with his cane. They exchanged punches, but Zing Zai eventually surrendered, shouting to Fu Delay to stop. Zing Zai pointed out that the snake they had been fighting over had already run away. However, it was too late as both watched in silence to observe the rapidly retreating snake. Fu Delay began to shake, appearing drained of energy, and it appeared that he had exhausted himself to the point of fainting. With evening arrived, Zing Zai set up a campfire and started cooking over the flames. The scent of the cooked food eventually woke Fu Delay from his unconscious state. Zing Zai greeted him, mentioning that he hadn't eaten for days, despite the intense battle they had. Upon waking, Fu Delay suddenly became alert and Zing Zai questioned his origin, suspecting him of being associated with the Ring tribe. Zing Zai explained to Fu Delay that they were in a remote location and couldn't search for their families to ask for food. He mentioned that he found some potatoes nearby, which saved them from starvation. As he blew on his food to cool it down, Zing Zai commented on how good it smelled. Fu Delay, still doubtful, stared at Zing Zai. Zing Zai continued, stating that they couldn't survive alone in such a poor place and proposed that they stick together. He offered a share of the cooked food to Fu Delay and introduced himself as Lai Zing Zai. With a warm smile, he asked for Fu Delay's name. Fu Delay, initially surprised, hesitated briefly before revealing his name as Fu Delay. In the evening, in the city of Chang'an, Cheng Dalei and his group hurriedly walked in town. Chen Ji asked Cheng Dalei where they were going, with Ling'er. Cheng Dalei explained that they were heading to a place he referred to as the Wily Hare with three burrows, which he considered a special place. Curious, Cheng Dalei inquired if anyone was following them. Chen Ji mentioned having noticed a beggar who seemed to be watching them, prompting him to wonder if they were being tracked. He glanced nervously behind him. Ling'er interjected, informing Shen Ji that the beggar was blind. Shen Ji, somewhat embarrassed, laughed it off, acknowledging the importance of caution. Cheng Dalei indicated that they had now arrived. Shen Ji inquired whether the house they had reached belonged to Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei explained that to ensure privacy and prevent eavesdropping, all the houses in that area were under his control. Shen Ji jokingly pointed out the extravagance of owning so many houses without living in them. Cheng Dalei responded, saying that these properties were given to him by those under his authority. He then instructed Ling'er to fetch a bucket of water to assist with makeup removal, while Shen Ji was directed to release the fireworks. Cheng Dalei issued the command to release the fireworks. In various parts of the city, people who were busy in the street did not notice the upcoming fireworks. In one area, a lady was haggling over the price of a jewel with a seller. The lady inquired if the jewel could be bought for 5 yuan, to which the seller playfully suggested increasing the offer. The seller proposed 7 coppers but became entranced after the fireworks exploded, while the lady remained focused on the purchase. Undeterred by the distraction, the lady insisted, demanding to know if the seller still intended to sell the item, while the seller was shocked by it. Suddenly, the seller had a change of heart and decided to offer the jewel for free. In other parts of the city, including where Jai Tao was located, she witnessed the spectacle of the fireworks. Jai Tao, in a flirtatious manner, playfully questioned whether Cheng Dalei had been responsible for releasing the dazzling fireworks. In another direction within the city, another man was engrossed in conversation, narrating the last part of a chapter involving Jin Lion and a king. However, his words trailed off as he caught sight of the fireworks. He was taken aback and surprised by the sudden display, wide open the window. The person he was talking to then questioned his sudden runaway, seemingly bewildered by his abrupt departure. As the three men looked outside and called the man named Ajie, wondering why he had left in such haste, while the other admired the student's impressive light body skill. A fireworks order awakened the long dormant underground forces in Chang'an. In an underground city, Su Ying and Liu Zhai were immersed in reading a letter when Kin Man suddenly entered and delivered a report. Kin Man addressed Su Ying and conveyed Cheng Dalei's issuance of a fireworks order. He offered to send a message on their behalf. Liu Zhai, curious about the purpose of the fireworks order, sought an explanation. Aku clarified that the fireworks order served as a signal for those who wished to seek Cheng Dalei's help, repay his kindness, or establish connections within the big city. Cheng Dalei held a prominent position as the underground city's leader in Chang'an. 
Liu Zhai, displaying a surprised expression, inquired whether Zhai Tao would also attend. Aku confirmed that Jai Tao would certainly be in attendance at the event. Liu Jai addressed Su Ying with a worried expression. Su Ying reassured her, implying that Liu Jai's concern might be related to outsiders trying to get close to Cheng Dalei. Su Ying then suggested that Liu Jai could follow Kin Man while she attended to her own business. She conveyed this with a pleasant tone. Liu Jai responded with a pout and a blush. Su Ying instructed Kin Man to take Liu Jai to Cheng Dalei and inform him of the impending arrival of an important person. Kin Man acknowledged her order. Back at Cheng Dalei's residence, Fei Yuan was the first to arrive and respectfully addressed Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei acknowledged him and advised him to wait for everyone else to arrive while he was sipping tea. In the following scene, many people were seen making their way to Cheng Dalei's residence. Some showcased their skills in lightweight jumping to reach the location, while others ran to get there. They greeted each other and commented on the familiar faces they encountered. A bald man noted that they were all familiar faces, and someone else expressed surprise at seeing him there as well. Everyone who received orders from Cheng Dalei gathered in his residence. They respectfully addressed Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei announced that he was going to give orders to a select group of people who were staying to work with him. He called upon Fei Yuan, Axi, and Aku, instructing them to stay. Cheng Dalei then turned his attention to Jai Tao. Cheng Dalei appeared to hesitate, thinking about Su Ying's potential misunderstanding if he left her behind. However, he recognized the opportunity to make use of her skills this time, so he decided to include Jai Tao as well. Jai Tao was visibly pleased with this decision. Cheng Dalei continued, calling out the names of various individuals, including the blind swordsman Shi Tu Zhu, Mu Zheng San, Peddler Liu Neng, Mr. Storyteller with Six Ears Q He, Tomb Raider Expert Wang, Gambler Crow, Playboy Kian Ruishui, Mangy Dog, Du Hun, and Beggars. Cheng Dalei ordered dozens of them, all of whom were capable in various fields. He then addressed the rest, informing them that he had no need for their services this time. One person expressed disappointment and questioned Cheng Dalei's decision, believing they were the most qualified among those present. As some people continued to address Cheng Dalei, others expressed their desire to participate as well. Cheng Dalei remained composed, simply sipping his tea, which had an intimidating effect on his people, and eventually silenced the commotion by sternly telling them to scram. One person expressed frustration, wondering why he hadn't been chosen. Another person expressed their desire to work with Cheng Dalei. A more understanding individual cautioned against speaking nonsense, acknowledging that Cheng Dalei must have his reasons for his choices. Cheng Dalei instructed Qiu He to ask about two individuals in the city as he wanted to know about them. Qiu He asked for clarification of who he wanted to ask about, to which Cheng Dalei responded that it was Ji Zhong and Liu Qingming, prompting Qiu He to acknowledge the task with a simple understanding. He then instructed Jai Tao to spread gossip in the brothel and reminded her not to expose herself. He also called Liu Neng to do the same task in the tea house. He then turned to Fei Yuan and began assigning a task. But before Cheng Dalei could finish his words, Kin Man suddenly appeared and addressed Cheng Dalei. Kin Man informed him that they had received news that the person they had been waiting for would be arriving in Chang'an in three days. He continued, stating that it was Yuzhu City Lord Yang Longting. Upon hearing this news, Shenji, Ling'er, and Cheng Dalei were visibly shocked. Cheng Dalei clenched in his chair, expressing determination. He gritted his teeth as he thought about the impending arrival of Yang Longting, recognizing that it was time to settle a score. Cheng Dalei then assigned tasks and instructed Fei Yuan to infiltrate the military headquarters at night and steal their action books. To Qiu He, he tasked him with gathering information about Yang Longting, including details about his food and drink, wanted to know about everything. Cheng Dalei assigned Jai Tao the responsibility of spreading rumors about the two individuals and creating a rumor about Yang Longting's anticipated entry into the city to stir up the situation in Chang'an. Jai Tao acknowledged her task. Cheng Dalei concluded by telling them all to go and do their things. Liu Jai expressed her desire to contribute and assist Cheng Dalei with his work. Cheng Dalei, concerned for her safety, initially urged her to return to Su Ying, citing the dangerous task he was about to do. Liu Zhai persisted, acknowledging her inability to fight and her lack of management skills compared to Su Ying and others. She thinks about Jai Tao at the same time. However, she emphasized her willingness to help in any way she could, such as reading and writing or assisting with his chores. She expressed a sense of frustration, feeling that Cheng Dalei often forgot about her and her desire to help with something that she was capable of. In tears, Liu Zhai pleaded with Cheng Dalei not to leave her behind, expressing her desire not to hide behind him and to actively follow him. Cheng Dalei eventually patted her head while agreeing. 
He then instructed her to help him with handling information. Liu Zhai hugged him tightly in response to his consent, and Cheng Dale emphasized the need for her to behave. Cheng Dale then directed Shenji and Ling'er to return to the examiner's residence, with instructions to inform him if something happened in the imperial court. He also instructed them to direct Wanner to meet him at his residence. After a while, Liu Zhai handed Cheng Dale a bunch of information. She informed him that all the valuable information about Liu Qingming and Ji Yuzhong was included in the documents. The documents contain details about Liu Qingming, the son of Xinliang city lord in Jingzhu, 28 years old. When he was young, he learned martial arts from the famous master. At the age of 19, he defeated 1,000 bandits with 300 house slaves. Later, he joined the Capital Guard Army and was known for his boldness, righteousness, and generosity in the army. Ji Yuzhong, 26 years old. When he was young, his family was poor and he studied poetry and books. Later, he studied with Qi, a great renowned scholar in Jingzhu, and entered the Imperial College, where he was the first student. Liu Zhai explained that these two individuals represented both military and civil officials. Qi hailed from the Qi family, while Liu Qingming's father was once a subordinate of Yu Chili. Cheng Dalei let out a sigh in response to the information, and Liu Zhai appeared to pout at his reaction. Liu Zhai noticed Cheng Dalei's somber mood, so she asked him what was wrong. As Cheng Dalei dwelt on Wanner's words, he contemplated the significance of being considered an elite-level second generation and a phoenix man, recognizing the nature of the two people who are high rank as monsters. He couldn't help but express dismay at Wanner's judgment, with expressed disappointment evident in his thoughts. Cheng Dalei speculated about the immense power wielded by these two figures, believing them to be strong contenders for the top martial arts scholar position for both civil and military affairs factions. Liu Zhai brought Cheng Dalei back to the present, reminding him that their people were still waiting outside for his instructions. Cheng Dalei resolved to adhere to Wanner's orders and instructed Liu Zhai to tell their people to proceed with the original plan prompting Liu Zhai to acknowledge his command. That night at Full Fragrance House Brothel, a man urged the ladies to hurry and fill the cup, while a lady complimented Zhang on his martial arts talent, suggesting he could be the number one martial artist. Zhang, full of confidence, chuckled heartily, saying it was only natural. Another lady then shared rumors she had heard from high-ranking officials, mentioning that the martial arts scholar had seemingly already chosen genius Ji Yuzhong. Another lady joined in, confirming the rumors she had also heard. Startled, Zhang asked for more information. Meanwhile, at a tea house, people discussed the news that the general's mansion had selected Liu Qingming as the top martial arts scholar. Others chimed in, mentioning that Ji Yuzhong was also a finalist. A few individuals dismissed the commotion, stating that it was decided from the start, and they were just making a fuss about nothing. One person concluded that they were competing for nothing. Within a day, under the efforts of several hundred people, the rumors spread throughout Chang'an at a very fast pace. In fact, Cheng Dalei didn't know that what he spread may not be just rumors. Under the deliberate verification of some people with connections, they got almost the same answer. It's only been two days, the rumors are getting worse and worse. The next day, Liu Qingming and Ji Yuzhong's doors were blocked by martial artists who sought a challenge. People shouted at their doors, challenging them to come out and fight. Some called them a cheater, while others provoked them, saying that they wanted to be the number one martial artist and challenge if they could beat them. At the Imperial College, over 3,000 people formed a blockade, appealing to the court for justice on behalf of the students. Several contenders questioned their worthiness, asking to demand justice, while others clamored for fairness. As night fell at the General's Heavenly Policy Mansion, the general's frustration was evident as he demanded to know who leaked the information. His irritation was visible as he shouted. A military officer reported the widespread rumors and the attack on Liu Qingming last night, causing him to lose teeth. The general, exasperated, facepalmed in response. In the end, the general speculated that this might have been the work of Magistrate Qi. Regardless, he considered these developments minor details and emphasized the need for Liu Qingming's recovery and preparation for the martial arts examination. At Qi Mansion, Magistrate Qi instructed his officers to investigate the source of the rumors, suspecting the involvement of a third party in the matter. Some officers speculated that it could have been military officials, but others dismissed the idea. Meanwhile, the general thought, as he angrily acknowledged Magistrate Qi, that he was good at it. Magistrate Qi also thought, expressed frustration at the situation, suspecting the existence of a third faction apart from the civil and military official factions. 
No matter how anxious the general's mansion and the prime minister's mansion were, they ground their teeth and stamped their feet under the pressure. Anyway, Cheng Dale was in high spirits, while Liu Jai beside him, and both sat at a table filled with food. A quarter past midnight, Fei Yuan leaped around on the roof and eventually made his way to Cheng Dale's house. Fei Yuan excitedly informed his older brother, stating that luck was on their side. He revealed that he had obtained the most recent ledger from both the Ministry of War and the Ministry of Rights. Cheng Dale expressed gratitude to Fei Yuan for his hard work. Liu Jai, curious about the purpose of the obtained information, asked Cheng Dale for clarification. Cheng Dale explained, noting that with Yan Longjing's impending arrival, the Empire would manage the reception, such as accommodations and protection. He mentioned that the Ministry of War and the Ministry of Rights were responsible for these arrangements, and by studying their records, they could gather valuable military and other information. In his thoughts, Cheng Dale noted that the negotiation team of the Ring tribe was scheduled to arrive in Chang'an the following day. Leading this group were the Kang tribe prince Hu Yanli and the northern tribe prince Jin Wendao, a name that struck him as familiar. Cheng Dale knew that the imperial negotiating team included the great prince Lai Leshen and officials from the Ministry of Rights and Minister of War. He acknowledged the number of troops welcoming Yang Longting was 5,000, which were highly powerful imperial guards. Additionally, Yang Longting had brought along 1,000 individuals, comprising those who had made significant contributions during the war and were awaiting rewards from the imperial court. He estimated that the number of people involved exceeded 6,000, and the true extent of the operation went deeper than what was apparent at the surface as he could easily tell it out in a glance. Cheng Dale pondered the feasibility of assassinating Yang Longting amidst such heavy protection, given his year-long involvement in various businesses all over the country. He decided that involving die-hard loyal warriors like Fei Yuan, Axi, and Aku in the assassination was not a good idea to let them participate. Furthermore, he pondered the feasibility of escaping in Chang'an even if the assassination was successful, and the potential to find the relics of Lai Manzi. Cheng Dale made a decision and instructed Fei Yuan to inform the others to wait for Yang Longting's entry to the city and find the right time. A man reading from a scroll announced at the city gate that it was the day His Majesty, the Ming Emperor, took an imperial tour of the streets. Windows of every house had to close. The idle, poor people, and thieves were not allowed to look directly at the holy face. His Majesty would go out of the city to receive the imperial warlord, honor the ancestors, honor heaven, then proclaim to the world. When the imperial expedition left the imperial city, they would splash the road with clean water and cover it with yellow cloth. They started an imperial tour where the lineup was imperial expedition of Emperor Ming heading front. Next were the relatives of the emperor and nobles, then came accompanying eunuchs, and lastly, came civilian and military officials. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale was among the military officials enduring the scorching heat on the imperial tour. As they neared the city gate, a soldier announced that his majesty was coming. Wherein, Yang Longting arrived with his men introduced himself, and uttered that he was there to meet his majesty and added long live his majesty while showing his respect. Emperor Ming questioned why the imperial warlord was so polite. He went on to say that it had been a long journey for him. Emperor Ming invited Yang Longting to come to the city with him. Yang Longting responded respectfully that he was only a martial artist. He only knew the loyalty of serving the country. He shared his majesty's concerns and dared not to be called the imperial god of war. Cheng Dalai thought in his head that he hadn't seen Yang Longting in a long time while the soldier near him was excited that he had made new armor on purpose because he could meet the warlord that day as he needed to make a good impression on him. Cheng Dalai's fury was clear in his eyes, and he cursed him in his head for being a god of war where, in fact, it was him who fought that battle. His attention was called, and he was referred to as Lieutenant Nui while Cheng Dalai was about to draw his sword. The soldier near him told him his eyes were so scary while Cheng Dalai was breathing hard. Cheng Dale smiled and explained quickly that he was a little nervous. The soldier replied that he was nervous too and asked how could they not be when they were about to meet the Lord of War. Suddenly, the soldier's attention was diverted when voices emerged protesting that they were determined not to make peace with the rings, and they would not claim vassalage, and would fight the rings until the end. The protesters continued yelling that they were a great nation, rich but not yielding, and they would fight until the end while the soldiers were trying to control the crowd with their spears and barriers. The protesters were yelling relentlessly in front of the soldiers as they demanded the deaths of the rings, revenge for their ancestors, and that they should not abandon them while complaining that the rings were multiplying. There was no brave general for their dynasty, 
and they mourn for the great martial arts. Yang Longting on horseback joined the imperial tour beside the golden carriage as the protesters continued yelling for the death of the rings. A soldier called the imperial guards, commanding them to get rid of the mob and to not disturb the conversation between his majesty and the warlord. Immediately, the imperial guards went on to the protesters aggressively, calling them ungrateful people and threatening to get lost if they did not want to die. However, the protesters didn't budge and responded that noble people like them, who thought themselves high and mighty, dared not to kill the rings but only played crudely at them. A protester yelled furiously that God would punish them while Emperor Ming and Yang Longting silently passed them. Fast forward at night, dozens of kilometers away from Chang'an, in the wilderness, a ring member reminisced that the last time they were there, they were having fun robbing and looting. However, this time they couldn't rob, they were there to negotiate and see if they could get a few more princesses. They would ask the cowards for more supplies, paper, tea, iron, and so on, as these things were very valuable in their country. With a pot of them, they could exchange a beautiful white woman. Meanwhile, inside the white tent, a man was asleep and laying on his bed. It was Jin Wendao. He was having a nightmare about the deadly and disastrous flooding where he lost his brothers, lots of ring members, and a flash of Fu Delay's face appeared. Jin Wendao abruptly woke up and got up with terrors in his eyes. He was heavily breathing from that nightmare. Jin Wendao thought in his head that almost a year had passed but he still couldn't forget that defeat. He thought of Cheng Dale, while another ring member addressed him as prince and told that it was time to go. Along the road, Jin Wendao went on thinking if he would have a chance to kill Cheng Dale and Cheng in this time since he had won such a great battle. He must have a share of the reward. A few moments later, after Emperor Ming received Yang Longting, the ceremony of ancestor worship began the next day. Emperor Ming changed his clothes and went to the offering table to incense. He made three prostrations and nine bows and there were no need to do the many formalities and rituals associated with it. Emperor Ming thought that the ancestor was blessed as he was inclined to the people. May they send down a few talents to protect the empire. A man was reading in a scroll and announced that after his majesty's greeting, the princes and officials were then invited to come forward and greet in turn. As the ceremony continued, Cheng Dale on the other hand thought the activity was really annoying. He wanted to get it over with quickly so he could hug Liu Zhai and listen to a little song. A man continued announcing about one dedication. All officials bowed, three knees and nine bows. Suddenly, a notification was heard by Cheng Dale that a nearby container was detected which surprised him. He continued to notify him that this container was full of power. While others bowed down, Cheng Dale only kneeled in surprise that this container was treasured for centuries and carried the luck of the country. It was continuously notifying that the host must get the container as soon as possible. The container that he discovered was powerful enough to reset the system and even upgrade the system to a new generation. It repeatedly notified the host, Cheng Dale, to get the container as soon as possible. The container was a gold relic. At night, someone was playing music, which was heard up on the roof. Bai Feiyuan in his flying toad mask was on the roof and was speechless. He then quickly jumped. A man down in a narrow alley was playing music. It was Cheng Dale holding a flute. Bai Feiyuan jumped quickly from roof to roof, until he landed near Cheng Dale and called him boss. Cheng Dale told him to send an advance notice of the theft to the royal treasury tomorrow, which Bai Feiyuan asked what he wanted him to steal. Cheng Dale answered no, he didn't really have to steal, he just had to get the attention of the Imperial Guard, especially on this side of the Hall of Ancestors, and they were running out of time. The following day at the Royal Treasury where soldiers were relaxed and dozing their backs against a column, an Imperial Guard was sound asleep on duty. Suddenly, an arrow was released and whirled through the air. This slightly woke up the Imperial Guard and was initially confused. Then, the arrow with a knotted white piece in it hit and got stuck on the column, which terrified and surprised the Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guards immediately yelled for an enemy attack, which they wondered if the ring fought their way in. They noticed the arrow with a knotted white piece in it and got curious about what was that. The Imperial Guards read that tonight at midnight, he would steal from the Flying Toad. They hurried up and went to inform the general. At night, a Flying Toad went on jumping from roof to roof inside the Royal Treasury. This was immediately noticed by the Imperial Guards, they yelled that he was there, and a flying toad showed up. Several Imperial Guards ran after the flying toad, tried to get him, and cursed that this little thief didn't give a damn about their Imperial Army. Another Imperial Guard fiercely commanded to hurry up and inform the men in front of them to surround him. The flying toad went on running and jumping on the roof, as he was supposed to, as fast as he could be. Meanwhile, an Imperial Guard was laying on the ground, and someone thought that the incense worked very well. 
Someone walked and thought that after the ancestral rituals, the spirits of the ancestors should all have returned there to the Hall of Ancestors. It was Cheng Dalei who walked into the Royal Ancestral Hall while wearing a face mask. He searched for so long, and finally, what he wanted was actually placed in the Hall of Ancestors. He had been searching for a year and finally found it. Cheng Dalei was near the golden container. When his hand was about to reach for the container, a sudden golden glow was evident when he touched it, which had sufficient capacity. A notification from the system detected that the host had acquired the container. The golden glow got big and surrounded Cheng Dalei. It also notified when the container detected and asked if Cheng Dalei wanted to absorb the power. The container was a relic from Emperor Wu, Ling Zai from the Order of the Heavenly Soldier. Suddenly, a warning notification popped out that the container carried the Empire's fortune. The absorption of its power might lead to the downfall of the national pride of the kingdom. However, Cheng Dalei continued absorbing, and the golden glow got bigger. Then the system asked if he wanted to restart the system. He answered yes, and it began to restart. The notifications went on and on. The administrator was going offline, and the new administrator was being created. It began to reset the system, and it was expected to be completed within 15 days. The power absorption was complete, and the system was full of power. It asked if he wanted to upgrade the system. It started to release redundant fear points. Suddenly, a beacon of golden glow was upon Cheng Dalei. It started to upgrade the system, and system functions were being restored. The store, summoning platform, and raffle machine were being restored, but some functions were temporarily available. This golden glow reached outside and went so high in the sky. It turned on the function for displaying the NPC information, where it was also upgraded, and character disguises were being ignored. However, Cheng Dalei had a hard time because it was making a lot of noise. The beacon of golden light reached and illuminated the night sky, which made the Imperial Guards question what that was and whether these were divine visions or manifestations of the ancestors, as it was in the direction of the Hall of Ancestors. Flying Toad looked back and noticed the beacon of golden light, and he was amazed that Cheng Dalei had created that. At the Minju Palace, a lady with long black hair noticed the beacon of golden light at her window, and was amazed too. It was Lai Wainer, the princess of Minju, and she said that it was so beautiful, as she really wanted to go there and see it. Emperor Ming saw it from his window and was speechless. Several people noticed the beacon of golden light and wondered as well. The age of the Kinshin in the year 20, festival time, at night, on the northwestern side, strange objects had appeared in the sky. Arcs of light were everywhere in the sky and on the earth, like a fire, wide at the top and becoming duller towards the bottom. It had a strange color and rose from the ground to the sky, as if it were transmitting cries of sadness. A man said that this heavenly phenomenon was unheard of, unseen, and questioned whether these were auspicious signs or if it was a deception of the heart. And the crowd rushed into the ancestral hall, except for the two fainting guards. They found no other abnormalities. Somewhere in another place, a group of men were out riding their horses. Someone teasingly remarked that the people he was with were too slow. It was Zhao Zilong, and he even said faster while Zhang Fei pleaded with him to slow down because his horse couldn't take it if he kept going like that. Zhao Zilong kept going and then replied no, because the horse was still in good condition. He told him to hurry up, and Cheng Dalei was probably waiting for them in Chang'an. Meanwhile, Liu Bei thought in his head about when did Zhao Zilong become so caring for Cheng Dalei. Guan Yu asked his third brother how far they were from Chang'an. Zhang Fei answered that they should be in front of them, and they went on riding their horses. A few moments later, the brothers arrived at the border of the capital region of Chang'an and got off their horses. They walked with them while they each held their horses' ropes. Suddenly, Zhao Zilong told them to wait, which left them confused, and they asked what was wrong. Zhao Zilong, with his sudden rosy cheeks, answered that he still had to make himself neat. Liu Bei questioned why Zhao Zilong was acting strangely, and Guan Yu asked what he meant because he had just said a while ago that Cheng Dalei was waiting for them, which made Zhao Zilong speechless. Someone said come on and they kept going. A guard at the border suspiciously asked them if they had a document for the road pass. The guard went on to say that Chang'an was under tight security, and they did not look like good people at first glance. If they couldn't show him their road pass, then he couldn't let them into the city and that they should understand some rules. Someone questioned what kind of rules. The guard looked confused while the four brothers just stared. A pretty lady soldier with a spear on her back asked why she hadn't heard of it. The lady soldier had black long hair and a ponytail. The guard was surprised when he saw General Tong walk towards him and command him to get out of her way for now. Liu Bei asked who she was. General Tong called for Zhao Zilong. Suddenly, she quickly advanced on her feet. 
With a spear on her back, she went aiming towards Zhao Zilong and said that he made him wait too long. Liu Bei warned and told them to watch out because she was coming at them while Zhao Zilong firmly grasped his spear. He also advanced towards General Tong. A white bird pilgrim's spear was evident as they fought. Zhao Zilong released a hundred flowers in disarray against General Tong's phoenix swirl while his brother stood on the side and watched them fight. General Tong's looked pleased as they went on fighting while Zhao Zilong struggled. Liu Bei yelled at his brother to go and help, and Zhang Fei agreed. Suddenly, her hand extended out and called him stupid brat. General Tong grabbed Zhao Zilong's head then pushed it into her chest and said that she hadn't seen him in a few years but his skills had grown which made his brother's jaw drop and puzzled him. General Tong gazed at his brothers and said that they were the guys that his brother Zhao Zilong mentioned in the letter while he continued struggling in her chest and demanded to let go of him. His brothers were shocked when they knew who she was. General Tong introduced herself, she was Tong Fei, Zhao Zilong's senior sister. Zhao Fei whispered that she was Zhao Zilong's dark something, but Liu Bei quickly interrupted and shushed him. Tong Fei questioned what they were whispering about. They awkwardly laughed and replied that they didn't expect that Zhao Zilong actually had such a powerful senior sister. Tong Fei brushed them off, responded that they were sweet talkers and told them to come follow her into the city. A few moments later at the Tong mansion, Tea was poured in a cup inside a room. The four brothers sat together across Tong Fei and said that they had come to Chang'an to do something important. Zhao Zilong respectfully said that they would be a bother to his senior sister for a bit because they were unfamiliar with the place, so they had to find a place to stay first. He thanked his senior sister for having them, and Tong Fei replied that she could trust the people that he brought. Tong Fei added that he could rest there for as long as he wanted as she had enough empty rooms there. Then she asked if they were going to take part in the martial arts examination this time and if he brought his name card and Zhao Zilong answered no because they were there to find someone. Tong Fei asked who they were looking for because she had some influence in Chang'an, so she might be able to help them. Zhao Zilong replied that they did not want to trouble senior sister and awkwardly laughed as they would take care of it. Tong Fei looked puzzled. The four brothers gazed and listened to Tong Fei when she intriguingly asked if the person they were looking for was a fugitive. The four brothers were all speechless. Tong Fei chuckled and went on to say not to worry. Although she was from the government, a fugitive like that wasn't under her jurisdiction, and she was not interested in asking about the person they were looking for. However, recently, the Jingju city was very chaotic. The martial arts examination was about to start, dragons and fishes jumbled together. The Ring Tribe envoy had also arrived in Chang'an. In order to prevent people from causing trouble, the outside was now under very strict control. If they wanted to find someone, at least do it after everything had calmed down. Tong Fei was heading out first because she had things to do and she told all of them to stay with her for now, especially Zhao Zilong, not to go out and cause trouble. Outside the room, a soldier was waiting and asked her group leader Tong if he was the junior brother she mentioned before because he was indeed useful. Tong Fei replied not to worry, apart from Zhao Zilong. The other three were not bad either. The soldier fearfully reported that the Ring Tribe diplomatic group had entered Chang'an, and most of their Merlian Guard troops had been sent out. Tong Fei replied that it didn't matter, they didn't have enough people on their side. She would find a chance to try their skills if they were qualified to become their people. Meanwhile, the system reset was in progress. Cheng Dalai thought in his head that the most important thing for coming to Chang'an had been solved. The only thing left was to find Yang Longting to seek justice. Another soldier appeared and referred to Cheng Dalei as Lieutenant Nu and said that it seemed he was in a good mood, and he chuckled. Cheng Dalei thought in his head to take it easy. There were too many troops deployed, and the time hadn't come yet. That day's operation was more difficult than expected. Suddenly, two men crashed on horseback and went out right above the Emperor's carriage. They took out a few soldiers while others yelled for an enemy attack and warned them to look out. The soldiers gathered with their spears and surrounded what they thought were assassins. These two men with face masks and spears in their hands were killed several soldiers who were on their way. Cheng Dalei was just as shocked as everyone else. He thought in his head about who made this move without following his orders, and who were they. There were so many troops that day, and doing it was the same as asking for death. Two cavalry soldiers rushed to kill in the crowd. The civil servants and the maids began in panic and fled one after another. However, Cheng Dalei remained and stood still with his sword in his hand. He thought in his head that no matter which side of the power made a move. Now this place had become muddy water, while another soldier called Lieutenant Niu and told him not to go forward. The front was too chaotic, and they should stay away from it. Cheng Dalei thought that chaos was the opportunity. As long as he could get close to him, he could stab him with a killing blow. 
While yelling at the foolish ruler, these two men still went on aggressively. One of the two men screamed at them to die. As they were near the emperor's carriage, the soldier's priority was to protect his majesty and stop these two men. A man was shocked and terrified of what he saw. Suddenly, a hand emerged. It was another man. Or he fiercely grabbed both spears in his hand and tried to block them using his twisting hands. The two men were shocked. Cheng Dalei, on the side as he watched the fight, he thought in his head there really were masters among the eunuchs. It was Liu Aji, the top martial artist of Merlian Guard with skills of twisting hand and Jin Yang Gong at age 48, where he strongly said to capture them alive. An unexpected swish happened on the hands and spears. They were able to break free from Liu Aji, and a combination of attack from the seven-fold wave breaker spear and breaking army was released as Xiao Yu was called to raise the spear force. Emperor Ming was silent and still on his carriage as he observed the fight in front of him. He thought in his head about the Lin's family's wave-breaking spear. The two masked men were Lin Xiao Yu, the martial artist who had been in a lot of hardship, and Lin Chong, the top martial artist with a lot of experience. They both had a hidden attribute as Avenger and had the same skill of wave breaker of seven attacks. Then someone thought, how could it be them? Seeing the strength of the defense, his plans for that day were canceled because these two fools still came to assassinate and were planning to die. And even if they managed to break through to the eunuch, there were still several top figures waiting for them behind. It was Cheng Dale, and he went on thinking that even if the assassination would be successful, the three of them were bound to die there. Yang Longting was surrounded by several top figures, such as the top left guard, top general, and top right guard, which made Cheng Dale wonder if they were looking for other assassins. Cheng Dale, with a sword in his hand, advanced fiercely into the fight. He thought that Emperor Ming could not die now, and once he was dead, the situation in Chang'an would be in chaos. He had a hard time setting up a good trap in Chang'an where it could be completely useless, and it would be more difficult to assassinate Yang Longting in the future. Cheng Dale had to stop them and get them in his plan, while Lin Xiaoyu and Lin Chong went on battling against Liu Aji, who was about to lose the fight. Lin Chong cursed while he thought in his head that if you let this eunuch drag him down the moment the Imperial Guards surrounded him, he would definitely die here. He positioned his spear as he raised it, gathered his strength into his hand, and called out to the foolish ruler. Lin Chong threw his spear swiftly as he fiercely uttered to accept his death. His spear passed over the imperial guards, which terrified them. It was heading at Emperor Ming's carriage with several soldiers behind it. Liu Aji looked back and screamed to project his majesty as he thought he had messed up. However, they thought that it was too late. Emperor Ming still sat on his carriage and was terrified as the spear was incredibly near him. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei appeared near Emperor Ming. He tried catching the spear with his hands. Cheng Dalei was able to grasp the handle of the spear. He was struggling because the breaking spear was really powerful. Cheng Dalei was able to catch the spear in front of Emperor Ming without harming his majesty. He fiercely stopped the spear inches before his majesty's eyes. The imperial guards just stood there and were terrified as they worried for their majesty. Cheng Dale yelled in frustration at them to come and called them bastards. He pointed his sword and then uttered that if they did not surrender, he was going to blow them up with five thunder laws. Lin Xiaoyu thought in his head that the sound was so familiar. He thought that now he had a good look, those eyes and that nose without the beard. He wanted to call his village master. However, he was quickly interrupted by Cheng Dale, who yelled ferociously, called them dog criminals, and told them to not even think of running away, especially of escaping to the east. Cheng Dale told Liu Aji to protect his majesty and allowed him to deal with these criminals, on which Liu Aji replied that he would leave it to him. Liu Aji then commanded a group of archers not to shoot as they could hit Captain Niu. Both sides slowly moved away while pretending to fight. As the battlefield got messier, it became hard to distinguish friend from foe, and now no one was able to intervene in the battle. In the middle of this mess, the two criminals were able to break through the east gates of the city. Several soldiers were behind Cheng Dale, and a soldier on his horse told him to take a rest, allow his men to chase after those two. He would make sure that they wouldn't be able to escape. Cheng Dale screamed at the criminal scum, told them not to dare to run, come and fight him for 300 rounds. He then went after them. Cheng Dale kicked a soldier and let him borrow his horse. He managed to get himself on the horse's stirrups and kicked his feet with it. Cheng Dale went on screaming at the criminal bastards and commanded them not to run. Another soldier came to check on the general, who was on the ground, on which he replied that he was fine. He wondered why Captain Niu had such a big grudge against those bandits. Cheng Dale continued screaming at the scums that their death was near and went after Lin Xiaoyu and Lin Chong. 
Liu Aji commanded the cavalry guards to chase after them and helped Captain Niu catch those criminals. On the road, the cavalry guards were behind Cheng Dale, chasing the bandits. Cheng Dale whistled like a sound signal for the bandits lurking behind the trees and bushes. The bandit was able to recognize the signal. He commanded to open the sheds and let them loose. The cavalry guards wondered about the rumbling sound as they slowed down. The leading guard warned them to be careful as it was coming from the right, and another soldier commanded them to halt, repeatedly. The firecracker was attached to a tail. It was a group of violent-looking bulls making rumbling sounds. The cavalry guards were speechless as the bulls crossed the road, blocking the view with black smoke from the firecrackers. They coughed when the black smoke reached them, and a soldier called for his general. When the smoke slowly cleared out, they realized that Captain Niu and those two criminals were gone. The general commanded them to quickly go after them. They must not let anything happen to Captain Niu. A few moments later, in a small shed deep in the mountain, he questioned if it was really his village master. It was Lin Xiaoyu who was glad that he did not die on which Cheng Dale assured him he did not die as he was living perfectly fine. Cheng Dale was also glad that these two did not die either. He went on to ask why they were trying to assassinate the emperor. Lin Xiaoyu and Lin Chong were silent. Lin Xiaoyu answered that it was for his father, Lin Wantian. Cheng Dale thought of Lin Wontian. He thought he had heard people mention him before. The great Northwest general, supreme defender of the Northwest borderlines, someone on the same level as Yu Kai Lai. In the war one year ago, Lin Wontian abandoned his duties and escaped back to the capital, leaving the city to be ransacked by the rings. The emperor decreed him to be punished via execution of the entire family. Nowadays, if Yang Longting was the empire's greatest hero, then Lin Wontian was the empire's biggest villain. How many people would grit their teeth in anger when mentioning his name, and how many more would want the chance to spit on his grave? However, there have been rumors that he was merely a pawn in the inner politics of the court. The supplies that should have been delivered never arrived, forcing him to retreat. Maybe this was the real reason why the entire Lin family was executed, to silence the witness. Cheng Dale sighed that Lin Xiaoyu turned out to be Lin Wontian's son. No wonder why he wanted to assassinate the emperor. He then asked how many people were left in the Lin family. Lin Xiaoyu answered a few of the older members were able to escape the executions by changing their names, and what had happened to the family was passed on to him by an old servant. Lin Xiaoyu went on angrily saying that his father dedicated his life to the empire, yet they repaid him by executing his entire family unjustly. He must find justice for him. Cheng Dale responded that even if they kill the emperor, it won't clear away the crimes that his father was framed for. Cheng Dale thought that these two weren't the sharpest tools in the shed. He went on to explain that if he wanted to clear away his father's crime, he needed to collect enough evidence and confront the emperor. Only then was he able to force him to give him a proper answer. If they really killed the emperor and people found out it was done by someone from the Lin family, it would only have added to the misunderstanding. Cheng Dale called for Xiao Yu and borrowed his spear. Cheng Dale held onto the spear and went on explaining that the emperor could not die right then. The moment he died, the empire would fall into turmoil, and the crown princes would fight among themselves for the seat of the emperor, giving the rings a chance to attack them again. So, hide here for now, this was a place he had prepared for himself, so no one should have been able to find them there. As for food and water, they were under the floorboards. Suddenly, Cheng Dale stabbed himself in the shoulder and blood began to splatter. He walked out the door and said that he would pick them up when he left Chang'an. At night, a soldier on a horse was wandering alone in the woods. He sighed as they went the road with his horse. It was Cheng Dale. He had to settle his score with Yang Longting, and Lin Xiaoyu needed to find justice with the emperor. He looked up and questioned if there was really justice in this world. With torches, someone recognized Captain Niu. It was the cavalry guards, which confirmed it was Captain Niu, and asked if he caught the criminal. Cheng Dale sighed and answered they got away. They asked him if he was hurt, and he answered yes that he accidentally got hit by their spear, but it was only a flesh wound and assured them not to worry. However, the guards called for the doctor and quickly called someone to come over because Captain Niu was hurt. This made Cheng Dale wonder when he became this popular. At the Waiyang Palace where eunuchs and soldiers sat down at the front, a man announced that the emperor had been startled by the events, but he was now resting after taking some medicine, and everyone could go back now. His majesty also decreed that he would not blame today's event on anyone, which made the eunuchs and soldiers bow down and reply that his majesty was benevolent. In a well-lit room, Liu Aji informed his majesty that everyone had left. Emperor Ming asked if Niu Sanjin had been found yet. Liu Aji bowed down when replying to his majesty. 
He had already been found, however, he seemed to have suffered some injuries, but it was nothing too major. He played a great role in protecting him that day. He asked his majesty if they should reward him. Emperor Ming responded that there was no rush to reward him as he wanted to meet him personally first. He then asked if he recognized this spear, and Liu Aji responded based on the techniques used by the assassin. This should be a tidal wave spear from the Lin family. Emperor Ming held on to the tidal wave spear, then uttered that the Lin family still had people alive. Fast forward at the Imperial Palace. Inside of a room, someone asked if there was any news of Cheng Dale. Liu Bei answered that Cheng Dale was a wanted criminal. He must have had a new identity right now. Jiang Fei applauded Cheng Dale as this proved that he had hidden himself very well, and Liu Bei responded that if it wasn't easy to find, he was overconfident. Guan Yu added that he did find out that there was an underground city in Chang'an, and the big boss there was called Big Brother, but there were rumors saying that the ones behind the scene were actually two girls. Zhao Zilong said that it was a shame that the emperor was targeted by assassins two days ago, and the security in Chang'an was very strict right now, they couldn't go out and search for them. Liu Bei responded that right now they couldn't leave Chang'an even if they wanted to, and they could only stay there at Zhao Zilong's senior sister's place, eating and drinking for free, and thought it was a little improper. Suddenly, a voice emerged and questioned who said she was letting them live there for free. With a loud bang, Tong Fei kicked the door and debris flew because of the impact. She was silent, and light smoke appeared. Zhao Zilong called out to his senior sister. Could she open the door like a normal person because she had already broken three doors? Tong Fei laughed and said that it was a force of habit that Zhao Zilong should know that this was how she usually opened doors when she was catching criminals. She went inside the room, then coughed and went on to say that no one could get anything for free from her, even if it was Zhao Zilong. She walked near her brother and said she was there to ask for them to pay up. Then she sat next to him and questioned Zhao Zilong why was he looking at his dear senior sister like that, was she that scary, or did he think she would eat them up, while Zhao Zilong stayed silent. He thought in his head that he had a bad feeling about this, every time she began acting this way, it meant she was scheming something bad. Tong Fei placed her arm on Zhao Zilong and told everyone that she needed help escorting an elder. Liu Bei asked who. Tong Fei replied that no need to be nervous, he was not some major character or anything. The person they would be escorting was a doctor. He would be traveling to the general's palace to see a patient. At nighttime, in the general's palace, someone hoped they could ensure his safety on his way back from the general's palace. There was a small carriage with two horses attached to it and several guards near it. Later that night, two people went inside the examinee's residence. Inside a room, Captain Niu was informed by Liu Aji that the doctor was there. Cheng Dale was relieved that it was a good thing the doctor didn't bring any medicine with him. He had been drinking so much ginseng and tiger bone soup that he almost vomited at the smell of it. The doctor replied that his injuries had already closed, and he should be able to move around after a few more days. Cheng Dale said that he was not the doctor who had been treating him for the past few days and asked if he was new here and his surname. The doctor answered him yes and his surname was Lai. He was amazed that he had the same surname as the royal family. The doctor looked sharply at his companion, Liu Aji. Liu Aji said to Niu Sanjin that he would get some fresh air outside and remember to listen to the doctor's instructions. The doctor said the situation back then was very dangerous, and while what he did was selfless, wasn't he afraid of dying? Cheng Dale scratched his head and asked what he had to do with him. The doctor awkwardly replied that he was just asking. He heard General Niu was from the northwest and asked if the situation over there was okay. Cheng Dale sighed as he asked what was okay about it as he couldn't even have a full meal every day. It was already not bad to be able to survive. The doctor sadly remarked that it was that bad. Then he proceeded to ask Captain Niu why did he think they were unable to triumph over the Ring tribe on which Cheng Dale questioned why was he asking him and he could go ask the emperor, that old Foji. The doctor felt sad and silent. Cheng Dale thought in his head that this conversation, this look, he wondered why they looked so familiar and the look this doctor gave Liu Aji earlier. Based on his identity, he wondered why would Liu Aji listen to a doctor. He was someone who stood below one but above 10,000. The only person Liu Aji would listen to was the emperor, and this person's surname was also Lai. Cheng Dale quickly realized that there was no way Lai Zingzai, who liked to dress as a commoner, and Lai Wanner, who liked to cross-dress as a man, could be the emperor. He couldn't believe that this old foji in front of him was the emperor. Cheng Dale looked terrified and cursed himself that the apple really didn't fall too far from the tree, questioning that his ancestors were all cosplayers too. The panic set into Cheng Dale as he sweated heavily and wondered if he was too rude a while ago. 
he comforted himself that it was okay, didn't panic, just pretended like he didn't recognize him. However, the emperor uttered the old foji which made Cheng Dale terrified and silent. Cheng Dale responded confidently that he was right, they all called him that. On which Emperor Ming questioned that all called him that. Cheng Dale explained that he was blessed to live 10,000 years, hence old, and with age came wisdom hence foji. Using such a prestigious title to call the emperor, he then questioned if there was something wrong, on which the emperor replied that it was like that. The emperor asked why he was sweating so much and if he wasn't feeling well somewhere, and Cheng Dale replied that it was a little hot. The emperor placed his hand inside his clothes and said that he played a huge role in saving the old foji, and he was sure he would give him a huge reward. He got a piece of cloth then wiped Cheng Dale's face with it. The emperor called himself an old foji since he said everyone called him that. Cheng Dale panicked inside as he thought in his head that the emperor was actually helping him wipe his sweat and hoped he didn't accidentally wipe his beard off while he awkwardly laughed with him. The emperor said that this time he would definitely be promoted to a noble, but he wondered if there was any other reward he wanted. Cheng Dale replied that sacrificing his body for the emperor was something a loyal subject must do. If he was talking about a reward, what else could be more rewarding than being able to protect the emperor? Then he responded that it seemed like he wasn't interested in a reward. Cheng Dale added that not only that he wasn't interested, he wanted the emperor to send him to the most dangerous battlefields, the harshest and the most brutal places. He went on to say that as a soldier, to die on the battlefield, using his own blood to trade for the safety of the empire, that was the greatest reward on which the emperor was speechless. He did not expect him to be so loyal, and Cheng Dale replied that this wasn't enough to be called loyal. This was the duty of a soldier. Liu Aji was outside the room on guard and heard them laughing. There was a light near the emperor. The emperor asked if the battles in the northeast were not easy, right? Cheng Dale was silent for a moment, before replying that yes, it was not easy at all. The emperor said that they were defeated many times. The huge empire couldn't even stop a group of barbarians. Then, he questioned what he thought the reason for their defeat was. Cheng Dale responded that the ring lived in a grassy landscape. Although their population was limited, and they lacked iron, their habits made them good at riding and shooting. So, every man became a soldier, and they could replenish their troops quickly. While the empire built up the country through agriculture and self-sufficiency, the training time for a single soldier was long. The soldiers easily became the private property of the generals, and they were prone to civil wars, or they avoided war with the outside world to preserve their strength. Even if he could successfully destroy a group of the rings, in a few years a new group of warriors grew up, changing at most the clan's name. Meanwhile, it was much more difficult for the soldiers of the great kingdom who died to regenerate. Even if the empire defeated the rings a hundred times, this could not hurt the rings' ambition. The empire only had to lose once to be broken. They couldn't attack, so they had to defend the cities. But a long defensive line from east to west was a big loss of national strength. So, the defense got weaker every time. The emperor found it meaningful when he said that the defense got weaker every time. Cheng Dale proposed a solution. If he trained an elite army to beat their strategy of perpetual wars so they could directly wipe out the cause, the Ring tribe would be completely crushed. On which the emperor replied that the empire didn't have such an elite army and couldn't afford to support such an attack in the north. Cheng Dale added that he had active but also passive strategies. He was just afraid to say it. The emperor encouraged him to talk about it because he happened not to have a consultant next to him, so he could just talk about it. Cheng Dale explained that this method was a bit crazy. He could create an opening in the northwest of the country to attract the rings and use the complex landscape of the empire as a battlefield. Then, he mobilized millions of the empire's peoples and the entire population to resist the rings, then blocked the enemy's retreat and destroyed them by encircling the place and gradually engulfing the invading rings like a sea that greatly damped their ambition. The emperor questioned blocking the enemy's retreat and then destroying them. Did he mean that at the cost of millions of lives, they should lure the rings into the country voluntarily and even give up Chang'an? Cheng Dale explained that he wasn't trying to send them to their deaths, but to involve millions of civilians in resisting the enemy so that the weak could overcome and break the strong. The emperor strongly responded no because that was crazy and downright cruel. Besides, he questioned whether these useless straw-like civilians really had the guts to fight the rings because that was completely fantasizing. Cheng Dale replied that he didn't have another plan if he didn't believe him. The emperor was silent for a moment. He then said that he was stronger than he thought and he didn't think the old guy, Emperor Ming, would rank him that low again. The emperor said that he had one more question, and Cheng Dale replied to go ahead. 
The Ring Clan ravaged the lands, the royal power mourned the fall, the fluorescent fire guarded the hearts. At that time, the nobility and the rich families fought for power, and the vassals defied the law. If people had a disease, they could be cured by medicine. But what if the state was sick? He then asked if he thought the empire could be still saved. Cheng Dale wondered in his head that this kind of question a doctor and patient should talk about, and he was certain that Emperor Ming already knew that he had found out his identity. Emperor Ming gazed sharply. Cheng Dale thought in his head that this old man really knew everything. With what he learned in his last life, unfortunately, in situations like this, he could only break old habits and reform himself. He questioned even daring to say his answer to the emperor's face, whether he could understand it or not. Even if he did, Cheng Dale was afraid he would cut his head off right away. He was the leader of this old empire, should he overthrow the emperor himself. At that moment, the two eyes collided and the heart became similar like a clear mirror. Cheng Dale breathed heavily. He said it was hopeless as he laid his back. The emperor was speechless. Then he turned his back and made his way to the door, and left Cheng Dale in the room. Cheng Dale looked at him, and a trace of pity suddenly rose in his heart. Of course, this was a very ridiculous thing. But at that moment Cheng Dale really felt sorry for him. Liu Aji offered to let him help his majesty onto the carriage, and he replied no because he wanted to take a walk. Liu Aji asked if he did say something that upset him. Emperor Ming replied no. He said it quite well and was right in some places. Liu Aji went on asking if his majesty thought this person was useful, and if he was good for nothing. Should they kick him out of Chang'an and send him back to his homeland? Emperor Ming responded that he was useful, not only useful but also of great benefit to them. Somewhere in the palace at midnight, someone walked, and the brothers were lurking behind a wall. Guan Yu said that this guy didn't look like anything special. Zhang Fei questioned if someone really murdered an ordinary royal doctor. And Liu Bei added that given Tong Fei's behavior in recent days in the capital, she was by no means a minor figure in the capital. She specifically asked them to secretly accompany this person, so that must have been her intention. However, Liu Bei thought in his head that the three of them were just guests in her house, but she specifically dismissed her most trusted Zhao Zilong and instead asked them, who were relatively strangers, to do the job. Liu Bei thought that in any case, it was fraud. He wondered how many people beside them were hiding in this seemingly quiet night. Swords were drawn, and they called the quack physician, and they finally got him. Several people dressed in black and carrying swords ran towards the doctor with masks covering their faces, and they continued demanding to give their sons, wife, and dog's life. Zhang Fei was surprised that someone really came to assassinate. The people dressed in black went on running with the intent to kill this quack physician. The three brothers came to the defense and surrounded the doctor. Guan Yu questioned if there were so many people. He felt it was way too exaggerated. It was not an assassination, it was clearly a siege. Zhang Fei replied that in the capital, he had either eaten or slept these past days. Now he finally had a place where his body strength could fully express itself, while Liu Bei remained silent. Zhang Fei enthusiastically asked his brother why they didn't have a contest to see who could beat more people. Whoever lost would take over the other person's drink money for a year. Guan Yu questioned if he realized the current situation they were in, while Liu Bei thought in his head that the quack physician did not panic at all when it was so dangerous. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei went on fighting, while Liu Bei was tasked to protect the doctor and leave the rest to his brothers. On the roof, someone observed the fight and chuckled because they really saw it in them. A lady dressed in black said let the useless withdraw, and let Team Tiger continue and a man behind her agreed. Several people dressed in black carried swords and screamed, attack. Zhang Fei ran and questioned how it was that the more they fought, the more opponents there were, and how many enemies this old man had made. Guan Yu struggled and said that the opponents were getting stronger and stronger, just like Zhang Fei, who told his brother there was another wave of enemies approaching from over there, while a horde of people carrying swords ran after them. A sword swung in the air, and this time, it hit Liu Bei in the face, and blood began to splatter. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were terrified for their big brother, Liu Bei. Liu Bei remained calm and cursed in his head. He went on thinking that it wouldn't work, it was a trap. If they continued, it was only a matter of time before they got killed. One year ago, bandits trained at the training ground of Toad Village. Liu Bei observed silently their smoky fight. He stood there with Cheng Dale beside him. The rigid training bandits were Zhang Fei, Guan Yu, Kin Man, and Zhao Zilong. Someone said stop and the bandits obeyed. Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were visibly bruised, sweaty, and heavily breathed. It was Cheng Dale and he said that was it for today's training and Kin Man replied okay. Liu Bei asked Cheng Dale what his intention was. He knew that their martial arts were inferior to Zhao Zilong and Kin Man, 
but he still deliberately asked them to fight each other. Cheng Dalei asked how many moves he thought they could have handled before sparring. Liu Bei answered about 10 or so moves. Cheng Dalei responded that they had fought for more than 30 moves to determine a winner, and Liu Bei replied that this was because while they both were very strong, their fighting styles were completely different. He went on to explain that Kin Man could perform war-killing techniques, Zhao Zilong could execute professional fighting techniques, and the two had no cooperation. Cheng Dalei asked what he thought the problem with Guan Yu and Zhang Fei was. Liu Bei answered that they had fought with too much brute force, did not know how to observe, ignored details, and had no strategy either. Cheng Dalei said that he was right. What they had lacked in their fighting style was a brain and eyes. He referred to him as Little Bei and mentioned that he had never seen him fight, but he knew his fighting skills weren't bad, even if they were not as good as theirs, but he could be their brains and their eyes. Cheng Dalei added that he was a genius at leading troops, which Liu Bei questioned how he had figured that out. Cheng Dalei told him not to ask because he just knew, and in his eyes, all three of them had the ability to withstand a thousand armies. Going back to Liu Bei, while being attacked, he knew what to do. He called Guan Yu and Zhang Fei to listen to his command, follow his steps to retreat, on which his brothers agreed. Liu Bei thought in his head that there were three in the northwest, four in the northeast, and six in the south. He found it, the weak point of the encirclement. Liu Bei fiercely commanded to break through them. On the rooftop, a man told his lady boss that they were getting away from them and asked if they should do something, and she replied not to hurry, as they would strike when they thought they had escaped. In this case, they could see how they fought with all their might to survive. Zhang Fei and Guan Yu mowed down their enemies. Anxious, Liu Bei pondered who those people were and where the guards were, given that they were fighting for so long and failed to come. Then suddenly, a figure leaped behind their back. Unaware of what was going on, Liu Bei thought that as long as they could break the enemy's encirclement, they would have a chance to escape. Guan Yu was the first one who noticed and warned his brothers to watch out as the figure landed in front of them. A masked woman appeared and grinned at them. Zhang Fei's face distorted, and he told Guan Yu that they were going to attack together, to which Guan Yu agreed. They both slashed the masked woman. However, the woman jumped, dodging both of their attacks. She landed on top of their weapons with ease. The woman hopped up. She kneed Guan Yu in the face. Guan Yu's face was in shock about what happened. Guan Yu was sent flying as a result of the impact of the attack, which concerned Zhang Fei. Zhang Fei ran and yelled at Guan Yu. He attacked the woman with his skill, the Sky Catcher. Struggling, he then thought that the guy's strength was abnormal. The woman was still grinning. Then Zhang Yu released another attack, but it was easily blocked by the woman. The woman prepared her legs for a kick. She then kicked Zhang Fei in the face since he didn't respond quickly enough. Zhang Fei was also thrown and smashed into a wall as a result of the kick. Liu Bei leaped behind the woman, raising both of his swords and preparing to attack. The woman, however, turned back as she observed the approaching Liu Bei, who was going to slash her. She avoided Liu Bei's blade at just the right moment. The woman's spear hilt sparkled as she dragged it to the ground. She used the hilt to bounce as Liu Bei slashed her again. The woman landed behind Liu Bei. However, Liu Bei quickly turned to where she was. She then chuckled as they both readied their stance. The woman then told Liu Bei that she could tell he was a martial artist based on his earlier movements. An open box containing medical supplies was lying on the ground. The woman went on to say that she wouldn't have thought that Liu Bei was a dual sword wielder because he hid it so well. Liu Bei's eyes began to shine as his face was filled with emotions. On a narrow street, the woman invited Liu Bei to come at her because she wanted to know what more he was hiding while a number of adversaries stood behind them. As they surged at each other, Liu Bei and the woman continued to fight. Their swords collided, Liu Bei's face contorted, yet the woman continued to smile. Zhang Fei, who was knocked out, leaned against the wall, while Guan Yu was also the same. Moments later, Liu Bei sat on the ground, and the woman appeared in front of him, saying that she expected him to be stronger. The woman asked him if he wasn't afraid of dying and why he gave up. Liu Bei sighed as he lay flat on the ground and asked her what difference it made if he died sooner or later, people would die eventually. While the woman's spear was on his throat, he told her she could do her worst since he wouldn't move. He continued that if Zhao Zilong found out that the three of them died in her hands. Liu Bei, concerned that her little game would no longer be enjoyable, addressed the woman as Auntie Tong Fei. The woman removed her mask and cloak and called Liu Bei a stinky kid. Tong Fei grabbed Liu Bei's clothes. She was furious and threatened Liu Bei if he dared to call her an auntie. 
Tong Fei clenched her teeth and asked Liu Bei if he truly believed she would not kill him right now. Liu Bei didn't answer and just clenched his teeth. Tong Fei grinned, stating that Liu Bei was not bad as she actually saw through him and even lasted that long against her. She complimented him that his martial arts were not bad, and he also had a brain. Tong Fei laughed as she continuously smacked Liu Bei, who began to feel something. Liu Bei's eyes twirled as he lost consciousness. Tong Fei was confused about what just happened. Liu Bei passed out while Tong Fei just stared at him without speaking a word. A man appeared and told Tong Fei that she didn't properly control her strength. Tong Fei placed one of her palms on her forehead, told the man he was talking nonsense, and inquired if he had caught anyone. The man informed her that it was truly surprising that an unknown number of assassins had invaded Chang as he took off his face. The man also took off his hair and continued that that night alone, they had caught a few opportunists. He went on to say that they still had to figure out who they belonged to. The man was also curious as to whether it was Jiang Hu's Moon Song Temple or Ling Zhu Pavilion, or the Blood Assassins. Tong Fei told the man that she wanted a thorough investigation into all of them, and to find out who was the rat in the Imperial Court because otherwise, she wondered how they found out about the operation tonight, and she also told him that his acting as the Emperor's double was too rough and that she would find him an acting teacher later. However, the man laughed, asking her to spare him, as they should worry about the three fellows on the ground first. Tong Fei ordered the Tiger team to bring all injured people to the infirmary and the three to her palace, and the Tiger team did so. Tong Fei, irritated, stated that with the Merlian guards around, she couldn't imagine how a bunch of riffraff could cause trouble, and it was about time to let them know who Chang'an belonged to. Female attendants gathered outside the palace. Two of the attendants gossiped and told the other to pretend she saw nothing. Princess Ming Yu stood tall, smiling. Meanwhile, Emperor Ming was present at the Yang Palace study. Princess Ming Yu arrived and saw the Emperor reading something. Emperor Ming's gaze shifted to the side, as if he noticed someone. He then inquired of Princess Ming Yu why she acted sneakily now that she arrived. Princess Ming Yu chuckled as she walked awkwardly toward Emperor Ming. She then looked at what Emperor Ming was reading and asked him what he looked at. Emperor Ming stated that he looked to see if anyone was capable in the exam. As he looked at the paper, Princess Ming Yu asked him if anyone was capable. Emperor Ming scoffed and told her that true capable people were few and far between because he didn't know if it made sense or was simply a bunch of cliches. His eyes then turned to Princess Ming Yu. Emperor Ming questioned her attire and pondered what would happen if word got out, which spooked Princess Ming Yu. Princess Ming Yu blushed as she told Emperor Ming that she learned it from him, prompting Emperor Ming to ask her what she meant. She then pointed to him and told him that she saw Emperor Ming and Uncle Li wearing commoner clothes and sneaking out of the palace earlier. However, Emperor Ming stated that he went out for work and she would not comprehend what the work was. Princess Ming Yu insisted that Emperor Ming should tell her why he went out. Emperor Ming disputed this, claiming that the entire empire was his and he could go wherever he wanted to go. Princess Ming Yu, on the other hand, still pressured Emperor Ming to tell her why he went out because she wanted him to bring her along the next time. Emperor Ming coughed and told Princess Ming Yu that they were not going to talk about it. He immediately changed the subject and asked Princess Ming Yu if she had decided on someone to marry yet. Princess Ming Yu stuttered and told Emperor Ming that she didn't want to get married yet. Emperor Ming argued that she would have to marry sooner or later, and she would meet someone with whom she wanted to raise a family. Princess Ming Yu crossed her arms and told Emperor Ming that she had not met anyone like that yet, and they were not going to talk about it right now. Emperor Ming warned her that she could not wait any longer, and if she waited any longer, she would become an old lady. He stated that he already picked someone for her and asked if she was interested in finding out who it was. Princess Ming Yu pouted, believing that if they weren't from the K family, they were from the Tao family, and if he forced her, she would starve herself. Emperor Ming, on the other hand, told her that it wasn't either of those two people. The person he chose was good with both the pen and the sword, as he actually stood out among the crowd, and referred to him as a bona fide genius. Princess Ming Yu's face was skeptical as she asked Emperor Ming if someone like that existed, and what they looked like. Emperor Ming rubbed his cheeks as he emphasized to her that the man did not appear ugly. Nonetheless, Princess Ming Yu remained unconvinced and questioned Emperor Ming what family the man belonged to if he wasn't from the Tao or K families, to which Emperor Ming replied that the man's name was Niu and asked what she thought. Princess Ming Yu's eyes squinted as she mentioned Niu's name. Distressed, Princess Ming Yu asked Emperor Ming if he wasn't talking about that man. 
After a while, Princess Mingyu entered through the gate, annoyed, wondering where Cheng Dale was. When Xiao Ling'er recognized her, she told her that Cheng Dale was resting in the yard. She stood near Cheng Dale, who was asleep, with her arms crossed, staring at him angrily and not saying anything. She then slapped him, causing Cheng Dale to scream. Cheng Dale cursed at her asking Princess Mingyu what was wrong with her. Princess Mingyu asked him what he said to Emperor Ming, which perplexed Cheng Dale because he had never met her father. She then mocked him, wondering what talented genius he was and he should simply go back to his mountain since she didn't know whether he was worthy, to which made Cheng Dale more confused. Princess Mingyu quickly ran and cursed at him and told him that no wonder why he was so interested in her matters because he was just a perverted toad that wanted to eat swan meat. She continued to mock him, telling him that he should never forget that he was just a mountain bandit and would forever be a bandit. She then left, leaving Cheng Dale puzzled about what had just happened. Cheng Dale was thinking about what had just happened when Princess Mingyu came and began hitting and screaming at him, calling him a toad who wanted to eat swan meat wondering what was wrong with that as it was the motto of his toad village. Liu Bei mumbled in his sleep as the night passed. Someone then called his attention, asking him if he were finally awake. Tong Fei, who was sitting beside him, asked Liu Bei if he wanted to talk. As he turned away from Tong Fei, Liu Bei's face showed disappointment. Regardless, Tong Fei just laughed it off and told Liu Bei not to look at her like that. She then informed Liu Bei that the situation was dangerous and that if the three of them went together, they might have a chance to beat her, and she wondered why he refused to act in the end. Liu Bei grabbed his blanket as he told Tong Fei that it was none of his business. Tong Fei then told Liu not to mind it as she also didn't like to gossip about other people's privacy either. She asked him another question about how he knew that the commission was fake, to which Liu Bei answered that it was not a big deal as there were many things missing. Tong Fei then interrogated him as to how it was possible. Liu Bei cautioned her that the imperial physician they were protecting was too calm and composed to be an assassin. But Tong Fei retorted that the next time she should find someone with better acting skills. Liu Bei guessed that the general's mansion, as well as the location they were given, were both fakes, as the place where they fought was not far from the general's mansion. But the general's mansion did not move after a long fight. He also added that the biggest possibility was that someone from the military was involved in the assassination, and that there were no movements from the Imperial Guard in Chang'an. Tong Fei then told him to continue. Liu Bei then told her that it appeared as if they deliberately left them to escape because so many assassins appeared at the same time, as they must have carried out a very tight plan. He also believed that the encirclement had a loophole and flaws, which did not make sense. He went on to say that he and Zhao Zilong received the task of escorting the imperial physician, but Zhao Zilong hadn't appeared, as he presumed he got a different location, and Liu Bei assumed that Tong Fei was planning the assassination the whole time. Liu Bei sat down and asked Tong Fei if she deliberately put Zhao Zilong away to play such a fake game to test their ability, as he claimed she knew Zhao Zilong's details and abilities best as Zhao Zilong's senior sister. But Tong Fei stated that in the end, Liu Bei just lay down because he already guessed it was her and believed she wouldn't really kill him. Liu Bei asked her what her purpose was and who the hell she was for setting up such a game. Tong Fei chuckled as she sipped her tea and informed Liu Bei that that night, there was indeed an imperial physician who went to the general's mansion, and the location Zhao Zilong got was the real general's mansion. She went on to say that the real imperial physician was, in fact, Emperor Ming in disguise to go on an inspection tour. However, Liu Bei just scoffed as he guessed that it was really a big shot. Tong Fei continued sipping her cup. Liu Bei then inquired if it was the real Emperor Ming that Zhao Zilong was escorting while they were fighting desperately, and the real Emperor Ming had safely returned to the palace, to which Tong Fei said yes. Tong Fei went on to inform Liu Bei that Chang'an had not been peaceful recently, and all forces were eyeing Emperor Ming, wanting his life because he had been surrounded by many spies, and according to their investigation, the news that Emperor Ming left the palace last night in disguise was also leaked. She went on to say that she expected the assassination operation had brought out a lot of assassins who had been fishing in troubled waters, and they had caught them all, so they deliberately spread fake news and staged a fake assassination scene. Liu Bei complimented her she did a nice move and inquired what did it have to do with them and why did she involve them in her tests. Tong Fei informed him that the kingdom was not only in crisis because of the Ring tribe invasion, but that the kingdom was on the verge of destruction because Emperor Ming was in danger at all times. A slight negligence would lead to chaos, and the entire kingdom would be crushed due to lots of internal events. She then informed Liu Bei that her organization was Emperor Ming's sword and shield. 
Liu Bei smiled, believing that Tong Fei wanted them to join their organization by testing their strength. Tong Fei also smiled as she held out her hands and informed Liu Bei that for the sake of the kingdom and its people, they needed more power and people with lofty ideals. Liu Bei looked at Tong Fei's hands, and she went on to say that the four of them were exactly what they needed. Tong Fei went on to say that as long as they were willing to join, she was cut off mid-sentence when Liu Bei's face darkened. Liu Bei stiffened his face and told Tong Fei that he refused her offer. Tong Fei was in shock and couldn't mutter a word. Tong Fei, agitated, told Liu Bei not to rush into refusing if he wanted to know who she was. Liu Bei averted his gaze and told her that he wanted to know but now didn't. Tong Fei's face distorted as she didn't say a single word. Seconds passed by. She told Liu Bei that Zhao Zilong was her junior brother, and even if he wasn't with her, she would never ignore him. Tong Fei continued, solemnly, asking Liu Bei if he thought Zhao Zilong would stay in a small toad village. She regarded Zhao Zilong as a phoenix, even if he was with them at the time. Liu Bei assumed Tong Fei had already investigated their origins. Tong Fei sat down and told Liu Bei that he had underestimated their organization. She then told him that she not only knew they were from Toad Village, but that they were also looking for Cheng Dale. Her face darkened as she stated that she could know every move they made for as long as she wanted. Regardless, Liu Bei asked Tong Fei if she could help them find Cheng Dale's whereabouts since she was so powerful. Tong Fei's face distorted as she couldn't keep up with Liu Bei's arrogance. As she walked out of the room, Liu Bei asked if she was leaving and mocked her that he couldn't see her off. Tong Fei slammed the door which made a loud noise. Liu Bei's ears perked up as he laughed in triumph. He then had a thought in his head that he finally had the chance to say it once, as he had always thought that Cheng Dale looked so cool when he said it. Tong Fei asked her men what their thoughts had been after seeing the entire test, and the man told her that despite facing many enemies, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei were strong enough to deal with them. The man went on to say that Liu Bei never did his best, but he possessed a very strong mindset and leadership skill. The man concluded as Tong Fei sipped on her cup, listening, that the three could be rated as a class. Tong Fei told her men that they could go first, to which the man said yes. She then realized that she needed to use all necessary means to secure such talent, and that the time had come to fill the manpower shortage. She stated that it was a little difficult, as she thought of Liu Bei. Zhao Zilong arrived, calling out to Tong Fei. Tong Fei turned around, surprised to see Zhao Zilong had returned. Zhao Zilong informed her that the four of them had come together and he had completed the mission she had assigned to him. They also had completed the mission she had asked them to do, as Zhao Zilong stated. He went on to say that now the three of them lay in bed, and he was the only one who remained standing. Returning from where Zhao Zilong had visited his brothers, he asked Zhang Fei how they had gotten hurt. Zhang Fei answered that if he had been stronger, no one would have gotten hurt. He then asked Liu Bei what had happened, wondering why he hadn't seen them. However, Liu Bei answered that he had been too weak and a loser. Guan Yu, on the other hand, blamed himself, stating that it had all happened because of his poor strength, as he had been stupid to fall into Tong Fei's plot. Moving on to the present, Zhao Zilong then asked Tong Fei what she had done to them and what had happened that night. Tong Fei realized Zhao Zilong's feelings for his brothers were deep and informed him that she simply wanted to test their strength. Zhao Zilong asked Tong Fei if that was how she tested people because they were all seriously injured and couldn't move while lying on the bed, to which Tong Fei replied that they were alive and that she would cure them. However, in a gentle voice, Zhao Zilong asked what it had been. As his face filled with rage, he yelled at Tong Fei, asking what the hell she wanted. Tong Fei yelled back that what she wanted for him was to leave Toad Village. Zhao Zilong gritted his teeth and didn't utter a single word. Tong Fei went on to say that she couldn't bear watching Zhao Zilong fall as they had grown up together. She explained that she could ignore Lai Guan Zhang and the others, but she couldn't let him hang out with the mountain bandits of Toad Village as she didn't know what kind of place Toad Village was like. Tong Fei yelled at him that it was just a bandit's nest, which everyone despised and feared. Zhao Zilong's eyes widened, and his face darkened as he recalled his day with Tong Fei. Tong Fei went on to say that the four of them had to stay, as three of his brothers had passed the test she had set. Tong Fei stated that if they followed her, she could guarantee a great future for all of them, to which Zhao Zilong replied that they were in Jingju for important business. As she tapped Zhao Zilong's shoulder, Tong Fei told him that she had always been a person who did things by any means and she knew that he was looking for Cheng Dale, and if Cheng Dale got in her way, she would kill him. Zhao Zilong gripped his spear tightly as his hands trembled, a golden aura coursing through his body. He held his spear with both hands and prepared to thrust it at Tong Fei. 
Tong Fei, however, dodged it with ease. Zhao Zilong's eyes widened as she grasped his spear in one of his hands. A fierce thrust was thrown again, but Tong Fei easily dodged it. She dashed towards him, leapt, and smacked Zhao Zilong to the ground. Tong Fei cursed, unable to believe Zhao Zilong had swung his spear so hard at her. She then questioned Zhao Zilong if he still wanted to fight her, as she was doing this for his good. Tong Fei opened her eyes to look around. However, all she saw was Zhao Zilong on the ground, unconscious. She stood up, scratched her head, and asked her men if what she had said earlier was harsh. The man responded that her words had been a bit heavy, but her hit had been harder and that she couldn't get married like that. Tong Fei's face darkened as she looked at her man. With a loud bang, the enraged Tong Fei walked away, leaving Zhao Zilong and her man unconscious on the ground. Cheng Dalei was recuperating in bed for a few days, and the military examination began. The contestants fought as the civil and military examinations continued round after round, and a large number of people were eliminated. However, in the military competition, the Jiang Mansion's highly skilled martial artists had the upper hand, both of their martial arts were top-notch, but the examiner frequently opened the back door for them, and the crowd of military examinations was more dissatisfied. And finally, in the middle of a moonless and windy night, Kjiu Jiang, who had just come back after visiting a brothel, was crippled. While Liu Qingming was stripped naked and thrown on the street, and as the incident grew bigger, the court finally issued a proclamation. A man reading a scroll above the stage announced that the military examination would be fair and square in order for the empire to select talents, and that those who spread rumors would not be tolerated. In that way, the storm gradually dispersed, but everyone knows that it was impossible for Liu Qiu Duo to become the military number one scholar. Otherwise, it wouldn't prove that the rumor was true. With a brush in his hand, Cheng Dale stared at the paper he held. Liu Jihan appeared, holding a spoonful of soup and called out to Cheng Dale. While Cheng Dale wrote, Liu Jihan fed him, and Aku informed him that the Zhang and Liang mansion had sent him a banquet invitation, to which Cheng Dale replied that he would not go. Aku went on to say that after 10 days, the military examination would be held to select the number one scholar, and stated that Cheng Dale should also be there as the emperor could make him an official, and at that time all the civil servants and military generals would be there. Cheng Dale blushed as he replied that there was no point in becoming an official because compared to the heights of the temple, he preferred the far side of the country. Cheng Dale asked Aku if he could take a look and help him push it. Liu Jihan scooped another spoonful of soup. Aku continued to inform him that the imperial god of war would be present at that time, not only to reward the military's top scholars but also to reward Yang Longting, while Liu Jihan was minding her own business. Cheng Dale asked Aku if Yang Longting would be there, and Liu Jihan, beside him, felt the food she had eaten. Cheng Dale then had the thought in his head that Yang Longting would appear at the military examination venue ten days later, and his current residence was heavily guarded every day and it was impossible to enter. While Liu Jihan was trying to feed him, he declared that if it didn't work, there were no more chances once Yang Longting returned to Yuzhu. Cheng Dale ate the food she gave him, and Liu Jihan smiled. Moments later, Bai Feiyuan arrived anxiously asking if Cheng Dale was present. He informed Cheng Dale that his two brothers left. Cheng Dale's eyes widened as he questioned himself if Lai Chong and Lin Xiaoyu had left and asked Bai Feiyuan if they were captured by the government. Bai Feiyuan said no and stated that he went there alone to deliver food to prevent information leakage, and that no one could find their hiding place. He went on to say that when he went today, he found that they left, that there was no sign of fighting in the temple, and that before they left, they wrote four words on the wall that said, see you again. Cheng Dale didn't say anything, and he had the impression that they didn't leave, but they were looking for an opportunity to assassinate Emperor Ming again and in the current situation, assassinating him was similar to courting death. He then instructed Bai Feiyuan to spread their brothers around the city and look for news about them. Once found, he told him to stop them immediately, and not let them do anything stupid, which Bai Feiyuan obliged. Cheng Dale sighed and mumbled, hoping they left. Concerned, Liu Jihan noticed Cheng Dale was not happy and asked if he wanted her to sing a little song. Cheng Dale looked down and thought about it. He got an idea moments later. Cheng Dale told Aku that he remembered the troop that wanted to see him and asked her to allow them to come, as well as Yi Jidao to come as he recalled she could play opera. Instead, Aku asked him if he wanted her to play opera to relieve his boredom. Liu Jihan scowled as Aku asked Cheng Dale what opera he wanted her to teach them and to arrange a play. Cheng Dale put his hand on Liu Jihan's head and remembered that she also learned to play opera. 
He told her he had an idea for a play and asked if she was interested in singing it together. After a while, Liu Jihan got ready while Cheng Dale took care of her hair and Yi Jidao took care of her lipstick. Liu Jihan finished her preparations as her hair turned black, and a luxurious tiara was placed on her head, while Yi Jidao was also done and looked as if she exactly resembled Liu Jihan. As the bright sun shone above the sky, a humming came out of the house. A man from the Ring tribe stood up and told them to execute the details of the peace talks. He warned them not to even think about talking to them. Just last year, they already signed an alliance with the Empire. Someone pointed to a map, indicating that this was the surrendered territory, and the city, as well as Yuzhu, would be theirs. Another man said no, arguing that they won the Battle of Yuzhu but was cut off. Jin Wendao wanted compensation of 30,000 tails in their paper, tea, and ironware. While Hu Lani, a ring tribe prince, stated that the chosen princess by the empire was clearly a commoner, as they could not fool them with a commoner because they were children of eternal nature. The great prince Lin Leshen chuckled as he expressed that it was enough for that day, and that they could talk about it on another day. Hu Lani pointed to Lin Leshen and said that they wanted a true princess, not a palace made crowned as a princess just to marry their step-king. Meanwhile, Lin Leshen just chuckled as soldiers gathered behind him. He then got the idea that they had people on their side who could beat them too. He cautioned them not to be too bold as it was pointless. He informed them that Yang Longting was in the capital and asked if they would like to meet him. Hu Lani asked his men if anyone had heard of Yang Longting, as he had no idea who that was. In addition, a man also asked who that rotten bastard was, while Jin Wendao was also puzzled. Lin Leshen mentioned Yang Longting's name but cut himself off mid-sentence. Hu Lani informed him that they didn't know him and hadn't seen him around. Lin Leshen whispered that the Ring tribe lacked manners and didn't even have the courage to meet the people who had defeated them. A soldier standing next to him murmured that his words might have hit them on the spot. Jin Wendao chimed in, telling them that if there was someone in Chang'an, he would like to meet him. Lin Wenchen stated he didn't know who Jin Wendao wanted to see, but if he was close, he should be able to see him. Unamused, Jin Wendao wondered who he meant by him. He informed them that he called himself the Toad King and that, while thinking of him, his name should be Cheng Dale. Lin Leshen asked his men if they had heard of Cheng Dale. No one responded since they had no idea, and they had never heard of that name before. Jin Wendao stated that Cheng Dale defeated them and massacred their tribe's warriors, and as a prince of the Northern Ring tribe, he was supposed to hate him. But as a soldier, he respected him. Lin Leshen didn't mutter a word. He went on to say that the Empire would definitely reward Cheng Dale for such a great achievement, and that he should be in Chang'an right now. Lin Leshen scratched his head, said yes, and mentioned that he would have Cheng Dale come to him as soon as possible, while wondering who Jin Wendao was talking about. Time passed, and the group descended the stairwell. Lin Leshen noticed a girl who was running. They bumped into each other. Princess Minju held her head in pain, which made Lin Leshen spooked. Lin Leshen, anxious, thought in his head that it was okay for her to fool around in the past, but how dare she come out and wander around today, as he stared at the stunned Princess Minjiu. Princess Minjiu came into her senses and noticed the big shots gathered. Lin Leshen ordered her to get out, and she obeyed by saying yes. Hu Lani didn't finish his question before Lin Leshen said that the girl was just a senseless little eunuch and apologized for bothering him. However, Hu Lani's eyes turned to his side. Looking at Princess Minju, who was running away, she then suddenly tripped, and yelled before falling face flat on the ground. She pushed herself up, face full of embarrassment, while Hu Lani watched the event happen. Princess Minju blushed, claiming that it was too embarrassing. A concerned attendant rushed, calling her name. The attendant helped Princess Minju stand as the people behind them watched. Lin Leshen awkwardly told them that his men had no rules and would punish them severely later, and Hu Lani just chuckled and told him nothing. Princess Minju was still blushing as her attendant was just behind her. Inside the Waiyang Palace, Lin Leshen reported that they were sent back and that the only thing that hadn't yet been confirmed was the marriage. However, there would be a result soon, and Emperor Ming asked him if he was done talking. Emperor Ming told him he had wronged him and told him to get up and talk. Lin Leshen responded that it was his duty to share his father's worries and that it was what he should do. If the Ring tribe became aggressive again, Emperor Ming suggested that he let Yang Longting do the negotiating and let them understand something. But Lin Leshen thought it was probably useless. He realized that the Ring tribe seemed to not want to see Yang Longting and instead mentioned a person named Cheng Dale. Emperor Ming inquired, and Lin Leshen responded that he was not sure what the Ring tribe meant, but that the Ring tribe seemed to be very respectful to Cheng Dale. Emperor Ming brushed his beard and mumbled that he heard of Cheng Dale somewhere. A man joined in, saying that the man appeared to have made a great contribution to annihilating the enemy in Yuzhu, 
and that he should be one of the lords of Yuzhu's warriors. He went on to say that he didn't know why Cheng Dalei's name was not on the reward list this time, but the emperor didn't say anything. Lin Lenchen bowed and said yes when Emperor Ming ordered him to check it out. Wan Yu asked Zhao Zhilong if Tong Fei were really his senior sister and how long they were under her house arrest. On the way here, Zhang Fei noticed Zhao Zilong was shy and eager to see her, and he thought he was close to Tong Fei. But Zhao Zilong responded that she wasn't like this before. He recalled Tong Fei as a tigress at the time and she was still easy to get along with. Liu Bei inquired if Zhao Zilong knew any details regarding his senior sister's current organization, and that based on the current situation, Liu Bei believed that Tong Fei was a person of great importance. Zhao Zilong shook his head and stated that when he left, Tong Fei was still on master's side. Liu Bei had the thought in his head that he was only concerned with pretending to be Cheng Dalei at the time and didn't ask any details as it was too late to regret now. He inquired of his two brothers' injuries and assured them that once they were healed, there was no way this place could trap them. Zhang Fei and Guan Yu simultaneously said that they were healed long ago and were just waiting for his instruction. Liu Bei then informed them that they were going to plan their escape route. A voice from outside joined in, saying that things would be fine now that their injuries had healed. Tong Fei pushed the door that made a loud noise. The door fell down from the impact. The four brothers' jaws dropped and they appeared terrified. Tong Fei informed them that she had inquired about Cheng Dalei and asked if they wanted to know. Liu Bei asked if she was planning on asking them to do something in exchange. Tong Fei responded that he had thought too much and that the news was free this time. She smiled as he mentioned Cheng Dalei's name and told them that he was already dead. Zhang Fei jumped from his seat, cursing Tong Fei and claiming that Cheng Dalei couldn't be dead. Tong Fei warned them not to underestimate her intelligence and asked if they knew Yang Longting who personally stated that Cheng Dalei died from a serious injury sustained while jumping off the cliff. Tong Fei placed her hand on Zhao Zilong's shoulder and asked if he was still angry, then giggled at him for being cute. When Zhang Fei asked if they had found Cheng Dalei's body, Tong Fei replied that it couldn't be found and questioned who could survive such a high cliff, and she heard that Yang Longting saw it with his own eyes and told them they could just ask him. Yang Longting's words, Liu Bei added, could not be trusted, and besides, with Cheng Dalei's ability, he could never die that easily. Tong Fei, on the other hand, did not believe that with that kind of cliff, even if Cheng Dalei did not die, he would be a disabled person. And it's possible that Cheng Dalei was hiding somewhere without arms and legs, waiting to die. Meanwhile, while Cheng Dalei sat at the examiner's residence, a song was sung, while Yi Jidao and Liu Jihan danced to the music. Cheng Dalei wished them well and informed them that that was the end for the day. Yi Jidao and Liu Jihan smiled as the group said yes. Cheng Dalei informed them that they were going back to rest before performing on stage the next day. Yi Jidao asked Cheng Dalei how she sang, but Liu Jihan claimed she could sing better than her. They confronted each other, with Yi Jidao saying she couldn't pretend she didn't hear her say that, and Liu Jihan saying Cheng Dalei thought she could sing better. Yi Jidao argued that she was better, but Liu Jihan denied because she believes she is the better singer. And in the center, Cheng Dalei was baffled by what was going on and how sudden it was. Both girls asked Cheng Dalei that he must decide, which made him sweat. Cheng Dalei called upon Liu Jihan, which baffled her in her small theater. Without asking, Liu Jihan came forward. Liu Jihan smiled as Cheng Dalei's arms welcomed her. He then massaged her face which made Liu Jihan blush. As Cheng Dalei was examining her face, Liu Jihan was still confused. Liu Jihan's personal information was disclosed as a young maid who was not well known. Her former nickname was Famil Rose. She was 18 years old. At the God of War residence, a squad of soldiers lined up. Two guards were at the entrance of the residence. Yang Longting sat inside, irritated. While still irritated, he rested his face on his hand and wrote. And as his irritation grew, his ink splashed and ruined his work. He then thought in his head that he obviously placed heavy troops in the vicinity. He looked up, however, he still felt that the atmosphere in Chang'an was suffocating, as if some kind of monster lurked. But in Yuzhu, he could cover the sky with his own hand by summoning people to the wind and rain pavilion. However, in Chang'an, there were many people of higher status who could be found everywhere, so he had to tuck his tail between his legs. Yang Longting closed his eyes, wondering when he could return to Yuzhu. Lai Shanyan appeared and informed Yang Longting that the palace had just sent someone to inquire about a person and asked if they knew anything about him. Yang Longting asked who they were inquiring about, and Lai Shanyan stated that it was Cheng Dalei's. Yang Longting understood where his sense of unease came from, causing his face to distort. 
He bounced up, asking Lai Shanyan who was inquiring about him. Lai Shanyan said that he heard it was the Ring tribe who wanted to see Cheng Dalei, and Emperor Ming already knew about it. Lai Shanyan asked how they should respond to them. Yang Longting asked Lai Shanyan if he thought Cheng Dalei was still alive, to which Lai Shanyan replied that he jumped off the cliff and shouldn't be alive, and they just hadn't found his body. Yang Longting paused and directed Lai Shanyan to return first, as he had an idea how to respond to them. Meanwhile, music was being played somewhere. Princess Minju arrived, announcing her arrival to Cheng Dalei. However, her eyes were in shock. She noticed He Jidao and Liu Jihan dancing. She approached Cheng Dalei and told him she didn't expect him to start raising opera singers and asked why he had called her here tonight in a hurry. Princess Minju leaned in closer, telling Cheng Dalei how scared he was and asked what he was doing, coaching opera singers. Cheng Dalei then told her that they were just going to talk and there was no need to be so close. She then asked if he knew how to write a play, to which Cheng Dalei replied that he was just teaching them how to rehearse a play for Emperor Ming's surprise tomorrow. Cheng Dalei chuckled and asked He Jidao and Liu Jihan to join him. Princess Minju recognized He Jidao, the Queen of Flowers, and wondered who the other sister was because she couldn't believe she was comparable to He Jidao. Cheng Dalei smirked and said that if she wasn't ashamed he thought that they should teach her how to be a woman. He Jidao and Liu Jihan approached them, greeting Princess Minju. Princess Minju called Cheng Dalei a degenerate, and even though he raised an actor, he lived in a plush house with a young concubine. But Cheng Dalei responded that she misunderstood, as people made a living as performers, not by selling their bodies. Cheng Dalei asked Princess Minju if she could do him a favor for the martial arts examination tomorrow. Princess Minju asked him what the hurry was as she told him his good day was coming and that Emperor Ming would make him a senior official in front of all scholars and the entire world tomorrow. She then informed him that she had heard that you had to be at least a fourth grade official in order to be awarded alongside God of War Yang Longting and asked him if he was excited. Cheng Dalei smiled and told her that he was now very excited. He then requested that Princess Minjiu do him a favor. Cheng Dalei stated that there must be singing and dancing on such an important day, and he asked if she could arrange Yi Jidao and the others. Princess Minjiu questioned why she should help him after he had gone through so much trouble to promote Yi Jidao. He then asked her if she wanted to know where her sixth brother was. He informed her that he had received news that someone had seen him in Kinju and that he was still alive. Meanwhile, on a vast field of rice in Kinju's Zimu town, two people ran, and a group of people behind them yelled at them to chase them down and catch the two chicken thieves. The people raised their weapons, they yelled at them to catch them and not let them get away. One of the two thieves expressed that stealing a chicken was not as bad as stealing a cow, whereas his companion claimed that it seemed they didn't just steal a chicken, but all the chickens in their village. One of them yelled to run because the group behind them was catching up. The villagers communicated with one another to search for, catch, and kill them, not to let them get away. One of the villagers mumbled that the two bastards stole his hens that were laying eggs. The two thieves murmured as the owl coos that the people of this village took chickens seriously. As they sat around a campfire, the man with black hair stated that stealing chicken and rice was impossible, and it was time to steal someone's clothes, as wearing ragged clothes made them look like ring tribe invaders, while his companion's stomach growled. The man laughed and asked Afu if he was still hungry and if he wanted something to eat, to which Afu replied that he was saying it as if he wasn't hungry because he didn't even have anything to eat. The man searched his clothes for something and told Afu, who said he didn't have any. He then took out a piece of meat teasing Afu if he wanted to eat. Afu drooled and asked the man why he still had it after seeing him eat it all, to which the man replied that he could tell him everything. He then took the man's meat from his hand. As Afu ate the meat, the man reminded him to eat slowly and to save the grease paper for him, as he needed to wipe his ass. Under the campfire, the man called Afu. The man rested his arms on Afu's shoulder. The man told him that he could hang out with him and follow him in the future and that he'd have tasty food and strong drinks. A red orb appeared as the system reset progressed to 99.5%. Staring at the necklace in his hand, Cheng Dalei had a thought that only a little was left. He stared and recalled the image of the heart sleeping. Under the moonlit sky, when Liu Jihan mentioned that she would be on stage tomorrow, and that she was nervous, Yi Jidao told her not to move, and she, too, was afraid that there was something else in the piece Cheng Dalei wanted them to sing. Yi Jidao noticed Liu Jihan kept referring to Cheng Dalei as the village master and asked if she could tell her anything about his past, to which Liu Jihan replied that it was a very long time. 
Liu Jiehan struggled to speak as she submerged half of her face. Yi Jidao realized that Liu Jiehan and Cheng Dalei had been through so much together. As she massaged Liu Jiehan's back, she told her that her suffering was similar to hers, prompting Liu Jiehan to ask if she wasn't another one of Cheng Dalei's outside love debts. Yi Jidao stated that it was a blessing if she could be loved by Cheng Dalei, and it was a shame that he only treated her in a mentor-apprentice relationship. Liu Jihan stated master and apprentice, to which Yi Jidao replied, yes. She then informed her that she was just an unknown herald with a good body but not much talent, and it was only a matter of time before she became a red herald. Yi Jidao defined a herald as a woman who sold only her art, and not her body, and a red herald as a woman who sold both her art and her body. She stated that she was just waiting for the brothel's old women to negotiate a good price for her innocent body as she reflected on her past. Then, as Yi Jidao stated, a big personality wanted her body but at an extremely low price. The old woman begged everywhere for help and finally found Cheng Dali, who taught her how to do makeup and fool others, as well as all kinds of gestures and postures. She went on to say that she didn't know how Cheng Dali could do so many strange things, like his aesthetic vision seemed to be several epochs ahead of them and other vulgar people. Yi Jidao stated that, in any case, she worked her way out among the many heralds who were under Cheng Dali's care. She went on to say that after a few months, she became the capital's famous flower girl. She then stated that many nobles wanted to spend a lot of money to meet her, and that many noblemen dreamed about her. Yi Jidao, on the other hand, was well aware that thousands of people in Chang'an desired her, thanks to Cheng Dale. And even if he were to overthrow the government tomorrow, she would still follow him. As Liu Jihan listened, she mumbled something about disobeying the government. She then had a thought in her head, with Cheng Dale's character. He would surely demand justice from Yang Longting tomorrow for the people in the Toad Village. And if it is true, Liu Jihan wondered if the days of living peacefully with Cheng Dale were over. She then imagined that when the time came, they would be separated again, and it would remain uncertain whether they were alive or dead. Concerned, Yi Jidao asked Liu Jihan what was wrong. As Liu Jihan emerged from the bath, she informed Yi Jidao that tonight was the last day. She then came out from the bath and covered herself, claiming that she couldn't do anything like she had done last year. Yi Jidao was confused as Liu Jihan exited the bath. She then wondered what kind of determination Liu Jihan had made. Cheng Dale turned when Liu Jihan slammed the door open. He then mentioned her name. Liu Jihan clenched her fist and covered her body, blushing. Cheng Dale blushed when he mentioned Liu Jihan's name, and his composure vanished. Liu Jihan stammered as she mentioned his name, puzzled as to why she took such initiative after the fact. She approached Cheng Dale slowly. As the blanket that covered her body fell down, she thought that perhaps it might have been a surge of emotion that built up for over a year, a watering down, something that should have happened a long time ago. She climbed onto Cheng Dale's bed and crawled on top of him, making him blush. Both stared at each other. She then made the first move and kissed him. She closed her eyes as Cheng Dale stared at her, and she thought in her head that as long as there was a willing person who took a little initiative and poked through the thin window paper once, it would burst like a soap bubble. Liu Jihan's gaze remained fixed on Cheng Dale, even though she was on top of him, and her feet stiffened. Then both sides came to their senses, and everything went smoothly. The two made love under the moon. Meanwhile, a system notification indicated that the system reset was completed. It welcomed the use of the Mountain Bandit System 2.0 and questioned whether the system sprite should be refused. The system stated that the system sprite Zin, who was in fusion, was expected to wake up in a couple of hours. Another notification appeared, stating that a mission reset was in progress, and that missions were being issued. As the notification stated, a new mission was received, and it was to kidnap the oppressor's wife. Liu Jihan giggled, mumbling that she could finally catch up with Su Ying this time. A new notification appeared, stating that the mission had been completed and that he had been rewarded with the flying sword technique which had explosive fireworks. Meanwhile, a group of soldiers marched down the street, while the four brothers watched from atop a roof. Guan Yu informed them that Cheng Dale's character would not allow him to be so restrained, and that he heard nothing about him in the entire capital state. Liu Bei went on to say that the martial arts competition was tomorrow, and if Cheng Dale was really in town, he would be there. Guan Yu assumed Tong Fei would be there as well since she should be working for the government. Zhao Zilong stated that perhaps their paths would cross again, but he wasn't sure if Tong Fei would be as gracious then. They then jumped at the same time when they were told to go. The four jumped from one roof to the next. A massive pile of paper was placed on the table. Tong Fei was resting beside it. As she read, she pondered that in Yuzhu, there were rumors that the Toad Village had wiped out the Hundred Ringers, and she wondered if Yang Longting was not involved in any way. 
and, as she read, the Toad King was a divine axe general with divine abilities, as well as spells that summon the wind and rain. She then placed the report as she could not believe everything and thought that it was all just market rumors. Tong Fei sat, thinking that the only thing she could be sure of was that the Toad Village and Yang Longting probably harbored grudges, as confirmed by the way all four brothers treated Yang Longting. She closed her eyes and contemplated. Tong Fei pondered that if Cheng Dale did not die, he should appear at the martial arts competition tomorrow. A soldier appeared, greeting Tong Fei and informing her that they got away. The man asked if they should send someone to catch them. Tong Fei responded that they couldn't escape her as long as they were in the city, and there was no need because they wouldn't leave until they found Cheng Dale, and she added that she could probably guess where they would go. The next day at the War God Mansion, Yang Longting's young servants assisted him in putting on his armor, starting from his boots and ascending to his arm plates. Once fully encased in his armor, Yang Longting wore a somber expression as he pondered the stifling heat. Concerned, Shan Yan addressed Yang Longting respectfully, reminding him of the impending martial arts examination, and the people waiting for the ceremony to begin. Shan Yan couldn't hide his unease as he hesitated to ask Yang Longting if he needed the appearance. Yang Longting responded firmly, insisting on the necessity of his appearance, emphasizing the importance of caution. A single mistake could be critical, and commenting about others found it annoying. However, Shan Yan persisted, mentioning the inconvenience of the heavy armor, that it wasn't convenient to move around in the hot weather. Yang Longting Feeling somewhat withdrawn, questioned whether he truly appeared strange in his armor. Finding the situation awkward, Shan Yan awkwardly suggested that Yang Longting could consider changing into casual clothes. Following their conversation, a soldier addressed Yang Longting, urging him to mount his horse and walk through Chang'an's streets, allowing the city's residents to catch a glimpse of Yang Longting. However, Yang Longting declined the suggestion, expressing his discomfort with being in the spotlight, and insisting on taking a carriage instead. As they proceeded through the streets of Chang'an, a person addressed him and implored him to take care of himself. Another person expressed their desire to see Yang Longting in all his glory. Someone reminded Yang Longting to stay hydrated and avoid staying up too late. Yet another enthusiastic supporter was overjoyed about Yang Longting's presence. Inside the carriage, Yang Longting pondered the fact that even when he wore casual clothes, he still had to wear gold light armor with it. He also questioned the idea of riding an unprotected horse. With a vigilant eye, he watched the surroundings outside the carriage, concerned about potential threats to his safety, such as someone making an attempt at his life or an arrow being shot from a high place. After he contemplated, they finally arrived at the barracks. A messenger called Yang Longting, informing him that Emperor Ming had invited him. In a respectful manner, Yang Longting announced his name, stating that he was there to meet the Emperor. Emperor Ming, acknowledging Yang Longting's status, dispelled the need for excessive politeness and invited him to come up and sit with him. Yang Longting bowed in response to Emperor Ming as he agreed. He reflected that only those who have power over the dynasty have the privilege to sit with the Emperor on this stage. Yang Longting pondered the powerful figures within the Empire, such as Qi Zhang, the General of the Heavenly Policy and the key ministries, as they were the centers of power of the empire. He also noted the interest of the emissaries of the rings in the martial arts examinations. With a sense of ambition, Yang Longting believed that from that day, he, too, could rise and sit beside Emperor Ming. He envisioned a future where he would have a place of significance within the great empire. Amidst his thoughts, Liu Aji reminded Emperor Ming that it was time to begin prompting Emperor Ming to signal the start. Suddenly the atmosphere was filled with the resonating sound of drums as the martial arts examination got underway at the barracks. Cheng Dale then made an announcement following the drumming, emphasizing that that day marked the final day of the martial arts exams to determine the martial arts scholar. He explained that the competition consisted of three phases, archery, horse fighting, and strategic questions. Cheng Dale instructed the candidates to enter, and the first competition of archery was about to begin. The first competitor demonstrated exceptional archery skills. He hit the dummy target with each shot accurately. The host then provided a breakdown of the results, indicating that Liu Wu hit 10 arrows on the target, one in the throat, three in the shoulder, one in the chest, and four in the lower body. After the first competitor finished, Cheng Dale called for the next person to step forward. The second competitor also showcased impressive archery skills with accurate shots. The host again detailed the results for Quinn hitting the target in the head, one in the throat, two in the shoulder, one in the chest, and four in the lower body. Finally, the host announced that the winner of the first archery match was Quinn. Cheng Dale, though, expressed doubts about the strength of the two competitors, considering them to be average. 
he questioned how they could have reached the final stage of the martial arts exam and decided to view their information. Upon further investigation, Cheng Dalei was in disbelief as he discovered that the competitors were actually Jiu Zhong and Liu Qingming, and they were graded as excellent. He noted that both competitors simply changed their names and got back into the competition. Cheng Dalei continued to ponder the two individuals who were pushed into participating in the martial arts examination and believed that they must have possessed some skill, but in his opinion, they seemed more like attractive yet useless nobles. He reflected on something Wanner said was right in her judgment about them. While looking towards the platform, Cheng Dalei noted the idea that the faction wanted their own people to win and thought that these competitors depended on their family background to win the competition. Cheng Dalei also criticized the competition itself, describing it as rigged and expressing his belief that it was influenced by certain people behind him. While his gaze was fixed on Yang Longting and mentioned Yang Longting's name in his thoughts, Yang Longting's awkward smiles were suddenly shifted to the vague sense of unease in Yang Longting's heart, which was boosted to the extreme. He had a terrified expression on his face and was speechless with sudden emotion, while Qi Zhang inquired about Yang Longting's condition, calling him son-in-law. Terrified, Yang Longting contemplated whether his strange feeling of unease could be from the hot weather or the possibility of heatstroke. Meanwhile, on the other side of the spectators, there was another person, besides Yang Longting, experiencing a similar feeling. Jin Wendao's face showed alarm as well, even though he remained silent. As the competition continued, Cheng Dalei raised his hands and announced Game 2, the horse fight, instructing both teams to prepare. He then declared to start. The competitors engaged in battling and horseback riding, and one of them exclaimed with a forceful shout as he managed to block the attacks. Cheng Dalei provided commentary on the duel, noting that the horse fight between the two competitors wasn't particularly marvelous. While in the crowd, the military faction commented that, unlike previous occasions when wooden swords or spears were used, this time, the competitors were armed with real swords and spears. Another military member discussed the importance of the horse's understanding of human nature and its ability to make decisions on when to charge or collide. A civilian faction expressed excitement. While Wanner and Emperor Ming were focused on watching the fight, they could hear comments from their surroundings. One person commented on the competitors dismounting, with one wearing black and the other in white, and appreciated the way they fought in circles, forming a rotating yin-yang diagram. Another person commented on the intensity of the clash, noting that as the spear moved faster, the sword became sharper, emphasizing the risk of serious injury or even death if there was any carelessness during such a clash. Emperor Ming asked Wanner for her thoughts on the competitors, suggesting that if she didn't like New Sanjin, she could choose one of the two contestants. In response, Wanner declared that she wouldn't choose and threatened to go on a hunger strike if forced to do so, to which Emperor Ming responded with silence. Chuckles, Emperor Ming then turned to Yanli, inquiring if the Ring tribe had children. Yanli responded that their tribe didn't have such children because they had already defeated them in the past. Emperor Ming couldn't find words to respond. As the horseback battle intensified, the sound of hooves clattering filled the air. Liu Wu successfully hit Gwen during his attack, causing him to fall off his horse. Cheng Dalei then announced Liu Wu as the winner of the second horse battle. Liu Aji commented on the match outcome, not expecting a win and a loss, and believed that the winner would likely be determined in the third match. Emperor Ming acknowledged this assessment with a simple nod. The final part to determine the winner was questions about strategy, which was decided by Emperor Ming. The civil and military officials naturally took advantage of this and tried to get a good impression for their favorite participants. The civilian faction acknowledged Gwen's excellent sword skills, while the military faction noted that Liu Wu won and praised his exceptional skills, considering his age. Another person chimed in, expressing admiration and referring to the competitors as fine scholars and soldiers. Others commented that they believed Gwen and Liu Wu's skills were not much different, anticipating that Gwen might win the next game. Some believe that even in defeat, one could claim an honorable defeat, while the ring tribe in front of them remained silent. As the argument continued, one side believed Liu was better, while the other responded that Gwen was stronger. Amidst the crowd's argument, Yanli, who was silent, was visibly irritated by the arguments behind him. He then spoke up, saying that with so many people in the Empire, he questioned whether the Empire's martial arts champion would be selected from just these two. Amused, Yanli commented that it was just like that leaving the civilian and military factions taken aback by his audacious statement. 
Yan Li showed a respectful gesture to Emperor Ming and proposed that their warriors compete with the Empire's top martial artists. In response to Yan Li's suggestion, Emperor Ming sought an excuse, stating that the two competitors were too exhausted to continue fighting right now. Yan Li assured Emperor Ming that their warriors would not take unfair advantage of others while they recovered their strength hoping that the emperor would not refuse. Emperor Ming contemplated Yan Li's proposal for a moment before agreeing to let them compete, to which Liu Aji expressed concern and tried to stop. But Yan Li then complimented Emperor Ming as wise. Then Yan Li called for Xu Lei's name in the crowd. He instructed him to go and compete with them. Cheng Dalei caught the attention of Xu Lei. He contemplated with curiosity as he glanced at Xu Lei and thought that this was going to be fun. In preparation for the battle, Xu Lei stretched his body. Yan Li called Gwen and Liu Wu and encouraged them not to decline the challenge from their fellow tribesmen. Xu Lei challenged them not to hesitate to fight together and then both of them rushed to attack him. Gwen warned Liu to be careful, as the two competitors launched their assault on Xu Lei. On the other hand, Yan Li glanced back at Emperor Ming and reassured him by mentioning that Xu Lei was no ordinary talent on the steppe. But Emperor Ming did not respond and looked serious at the battle. As the battles continued, Liu Wu and Quen swung their weapons at Xu Lei, but Xu Lei skillfully managed to dodge their attacks. Amidst the intense battle, the civilian faction remarked that with one versus two, they should have an advantage. A military faction chimed in, urging them to put some strength. Another military faction commented to go after Xu Lei, with a call to defeat and even kill him. With just a few moves, Quen was swept off the horse, emitting a pain groan after Xu Lei launched his attack. Xu Lei, reveling in his triumph, mocked Quen, saying he couldn't withstand a single blow. He continued to mock the Empire's martial scholars for their capabilities after he swung his weapon forcefully at Liu, who struggled to block it. While struggling to fend off Xu Lei's attacks, Liu Wu clarified that Quen was not the Empire's martial scholar, and that he himself was the one being sought as the martial scholar. Xu Lei responded by saying he was next and then prepared for a strong attack on Liu, who was ready to block it. However, Xu Lei managed to dismount Liu's weapon after he swung his weapon, causing Liu to lose his balance. Xu Lei laughed as Liu Wu fell from his horse. Both civilian and military factions fell into stunned silence, their expressions darkened with disbelief. Then Xu Lei proudly raised his weapon high as he mentioned the martial scholar. He looked up and proclaimed his victory over the empire's martial scholar, then burst out laughing. With a proud smile, Yan Li looked at Emperor Ming and said that his men may not know the rules and do not understand what is important. He hoped for Emperor Ming's forgiveness while wearing a smile on his face. Emperor Ming remained in a serious expression, while the civilian and military factions remained silent as they wore expressions of embarrassment. Within the barracks, an imperial guard addressed Tong Fei, asking her if they were going to make a move. Tong Fei responded that it was inappropriate to discuss their status without the emperor's order. She cautioned his men not to go too far. However, the imperial guard expressed his concern and disbelief at the idea of allowing the Ring tribe barbarians to act wildly like that. Xiao Yu appeared out of nowhere, stood atop the wall, and wore a soft fabric mask. He called out to Ring's ruffians, telling them that they shouldn't go crazy because Chang'an was not a place for them to run wild. Curious about the voice, Xu Lei looked towards Xiao Yu. Xiao Yu then swiftly jumped below and landed flawlessly in front of Xu Lei. Surprised, Cheng Dalei thought to himself that Xiao Yu had not left yet. At the same time, Jin Wendao was also surprised and recognized Xiao Yu. Cheng Dalei pondered if Xiao Yu still intended to seek justice from Emperor Ming by dressing in this manner. He remarked Xiao Yu is an empire's noble and couldn't tolerate the ring's arrogance as he came forward. Xu Lei quickly moved to attack Xiao Yu, insulted him as a hairy boy, and questioned where he came from. Without hesitation, Xu Lei declared to take a strike from his spear. Xiao Yu, prepared action from the attack, told Xu Lei to come. Both Xu Lei and Xiao Yu launched their attacks simultaneously, resulting in a clash where they blocked each other's moves. Xu Lei, acknowledging Xiao Yu's skills, complimented him, to which Xiao Yu responded that he was not bad either. Xiao Yu unleashed his Wave Breaker Vort's technique and made it clear that he didn't have time to play with him. He managed to land a blow on Xu Lei's arms, leaving Xu Lei surprised. Cheng Dalei observed the battle, he thought that Xiao Yu could win in this situation. But Cheng Dalei also realized the consequences of Xiao Yu showing the skills of the wave breaking spear. He was concerned that if Xiao Yu's skills drew too much attention, it might lead someone to associate him with a previous assassination. He felt the need to find a way to save Xiao Yu. As the battle continued, Xu Lei taunted Xiao Yu and laughed hard as he told Xiao Yu that he could run away if he didn't want to fight. Xiao Yu found Xu Lei annoying and unleashed a formidable swing at him. 
After he swung his spear, he was able to dismount Xu Lei, causing Xu Lei's horse to get hurt. Xiao Yu skillfully sidestepped as the horse lost its balance, leading to Xu Lei falling from his horse as it ran away. Xiao Yu attempted to finish Xu Lei while he was still lying on the ground, screaming as he had the advantage. With a grim expression, Xu Lei braced for the impending strike, but to his surprise, Xiao Yu spared his life as he redirected his attack to the ground. As the battle concluded, the civilian faction rejoiced and stammered while exclaiming that Xiao Yu won. Jin Wendao was fascinated and found himself wondering when Xiao Yu became so strong. At the same time, Liu Aji acknowledged Xiao Yu as a teenage warrior of the empire. Even Emperor Ming couldn't help but react with a low chuckle. Xu Lei, still lying down, appeared to breathe heavily. With a serious expression, Xiao Yu exhaled deeply as he made the decision to spare Xu Lei's life. As Xu Lei rose to his feet after being defeated, Xiao Yu turned away from him, unaware of Xu Lei's intentions. Unseen by Xiao Yu, Xu Lei appeared to plot something behind him. Concerned for Xu Lei's well-being, Yan Li advised him to retreat, emphasizing that he was no match for Xiao Yu. However, Xu Lei called out Xiao Yu in a respectful tone, expressing his admiration of Xiao Yu, stating that Xiao Yu was more powerful than the two martial artists, admitting that he could not beat him. He also expressed a desire to learn from Xiao Yu, saying that when he had the opportunity, he would ask for Xiao's advice. In response, Xiao Yu glanced at him and affirmed his words. It turned out that the dignity and demeanor of the Ring tribe were only given to the people they respected. In acknowledgement of this, Xu Lei humbly bowed to Xiao Yu, who had just turned away from him. It was concluded that he was the winner. Meanwhile, the female audience couldn't help but be captivated by Xiao Yu's charisma, their eyes gleaming with hearts fluttering. One of the ladies inquired about Xiao Yu's identity, while the other declared her desire for her father to propose a marriage to Xiao Yu's family. Another lady couldn't contain her enthusiasm as she competed for his attention, while the other exclaimed over his handsomeness. At that very moment and in the same place, Zhang Fei told his group that it was Xiao Yu. It then occurred to Xi Long that if Xiao Yu was there, Cheng Dale must also be present in the same place. Liu Bei concluded that their trip was indeed not in vain, and they just needed to wait and see. While deep in thought, Wanner found Xiao Yu's face familiar and wondered if he had any connection to Cheng Dale. She speculated that Emperor Ming's intention was to reward Xiao Yu greatly, believing that he had the potential to reach the top in the future. He is here and standing in front of this high platform. It seems that the opportunity to rise to the top is just around the corner. In her thoughts, Wanner wondered why Xiao Yu was dressed in white, as he appeared to be wearing morning attire. With a low chuckle, Emperor Ming addressed Xiao Yu and asked about his name and where he learned his skills from. In response, Xiao Yu introduced himself as a common person, Lin Xiao Yu. He firmly planted his weapon into the ground before continuing to speak. With a deep sign of respect, he kneeled and explained that he came seeking justice on behalf of his father. After Xiao Yu introduced himself, the crowd fell into a sudden silence, with all eyes wandering as he remained kneeling. The general exchanged curious glances, while Qi Zhang pretended to nap. The military and civilian factions turned a blind eye. On the other hand, Jin Wendao, recognizing Xiao Yu, commented that they hadn't met in a long time and asked why he appeared so down. But Xiao Yu remained kneeling, wearing a serious expression. Curious, Tong Fei glanced at the Imperial Guard and asked about Xiao Yu, who definitely did not see his name in the post. She asked how Xiao Yu got in, to which the Imperial Guard was speechless. In her mind, she quickly dismissed her curiosity, realizing her position didn't allow her to blame them either as her attention shifted to Xi Long groups. Just then, with an annoyed expression, Liu Aji instructed the Imperial Guards to escort those causing disruptions in the martial arts competition out. Xiao Yu vehemently protested against the Imperial Guards who were forcibly dragging him away, screaming at them that he didn't mean to disrupt the competition. He continued to express his agony, claims about his father, Lin Wenchen, who devoted himself to being loyal, and said that the heavens and the earth saw it. Outrage was visibly on his face as he asked Emperor Ming why he beheaded his father and left a name that would stink for eternity, and desperately cried out for his father's return before the Imperial Guards were forced to cover his mouth. He wanted to seek justice, but sometimes, even the word justice cannot be said. While Xiao Yu was being dragged away, Cheng Dale appeared in the area and just observed the situation. But worry was evident on his face as he mentioned Xiao Yu's name in his thoughts. During that time, Yan Longting's thoughts reflected on the situation. He appeared to be somewhat amused by the martial arts competition being ruined by the Ring tribe and Xiao Yu, who shouted for justice. He believed that Xiao Yu would surely be thrown in prison. 
After the earlier events were resolved, Liu Aji inquired of Emperor Ming about the next steps, mentioning the reward ceremony. But before he could complete his sentence, Emperor Ming then instructed him to continue. Liu Aji then announced to sound the drums, fire the cannons, play music, and performed a dance. He also instructed the Imperial Guards to salute and mentioned that the next part of the ceremony involved a sword and spear dance. Wang Er seized the moment to inform Emperor Ming that she hired an opera singer to arrange a play to replace the original sword and spear dance. Emperor Ming approved of Wang Er's idea and expressed his willingness to see it. The audience at the event commented on how thoroughly prepared Wanner was, while others giggled, complimenting her for being so thoughtful. The beautiful melodies of the Gazheng filled the air. The audience's anticipation grew. A person in the crowd pointed excitedly while another shielded their eyes to see the stage more clearly. The performers, dressed in their striking outfits, gathered on the stage. As they began to perform their song, the Demon King of the North awoke. The sky was cold, the ground was frozen and snow stretched endlessly into the horizon. Liu Jai and Jai Tao, with their captivating voices, sang their part together. Jai Tao's voice was filled with foreboding as she emphasized, a calamity was approaching. Then, Liu Jai followed, her voice carrying the weight of the song. Yet the mortals were still immersed in their own little dreams and suddenly came. The demons donned black and sprouted fangs, accompanied their dramatic entrance, complete with eerie demon masks. The performance unfolded further as Jai Tao's expression turned serious and continued. The city walls were broken, the common people died, and the nobles ran. While she sang, she began to dance gracefully, illustrating the song. A bloody battle ensued, bones piled into mountains and blood ran like a river, and the soldiers scattered, running for their lives, with Jai Tao's dramatic performance bringing the scene to life. The peasants fell without a chance to run. Jai Tao illustrated her dramatic acting, as she looked up to the sky. The freshly sown farms were trampled on. The audience couldn't help but be drawn into the story as they stood on their seats, gasping from the music and acting. As the narrative of the song continued, Jai Tao's acting intensified as she portrayed the destruction and sang. Houses set on fire. Bodies of children hanging from wooden posts. Her emotions conveyed the sadness of the tragedy. And I too was defiled. She even reached out her hands as if trying to grasp the heavens themselves. The tempo of the song shifted, and another actor entered the stage. The song continued questioning, where are those who promised to protect us? They ran so fast that even the wind had to concede. Liu Jai emphasized the question, capturing the audience's attention. Why did such a calamity happen? Does heaven want to punish those on earth? Or do the gods not sympathize with mortal men? As the drumming grew more intense, the drama continued to unfold. Suddenly, a mountain warrior descended. Liu Jai engaged in a dynamic act battle with the demon. His gaze was cold and unforgiving, his blade a weapon of mass slaughter. Although he was alone, he stood his ground against an army of tens of thousands. On the first day, the soldiers feasted. On the second day, armors were donned. The drumming became more intense, conveying the narrative of the performance. The dong from the drum resonated in the air. On the third day, swords were unsheathed. On the fourth day, the soldiers fought. They acted as if the demon won the battle between the soldiers. Fought, bled, killed. To the front, the war raged. To the back, our people schemed. It turned out I was always alone in this war. The audience was left speechless by the performance as they felt a deep connection to the song. While Qi Xiang's somber expression mirrored the gravity of the song's narrative, the old general had no food to feed the soldiers and was defeated he returned to the capital and was decapitated. Finally, as the demon tribe was forced out of their lands, the demon conveyed their defeat. The noble who ran returned and was hailed as a commander, portrayed humorously by the clown actor. He did nothing, yet was praised to the heavens. How unjust is the world? Do you not have battle armors? Come, let us share mine. Jai Tao's face showed emotion of unfairness as she sang. Do you not have battle armors? Come, we shall fight together. Do you not have battle armors? Come, brother, I met you on the other side. By the time the three lines were sung, the audience was left in stunned silence. Uncertain emotions filled the air. All eyes turned to Emperor Ming's face, attempting to gauge his reaction. They pondered if Emperor Ming could continue watching it. Emperor Ming's expression, once passive, was now serious and intrigued as he commented that the performance was interesting. Jin Wendao suddenly stood up during the performance, his jaw clenched as he knew that Cheng Dalei was there. He appeared to be terrified, believing that Cheng Dalei was there right now. He thought that Cheng Dalei was dead but now sure that he was alive and present there. His face shifted from terror to concern as he looked at his surroundings. Right now, Yang Longting's inner thoughts were in a mess and his heart was racing, as he thought that Cheng Dalei wasn't dead. 
He cursed in his mind, realizing he should have known when they couldn't find Cheng Dale's corpse. Fear was evident in his eyes as he imagined Cheng Dale had already found his way there. He anxiously wondered where Cheng Dale was and who he might be disguised as. Meanwhile, at the performance, the drums died down, but the performers continued their act, with Jai Tao still singing. The wicked demon king had been banished. Yet, the hero who killed him was persecuted by the people. Liu Jai acted as though, as she presented the narration that she had been captured, while the noble who ran away was glorified by the people. The audience was open-mouthed because the impact of the song and performance was so real. Amidst the performance, Jai Tao walked to the center as she continued to sing, The Black Dog Chased Flies in the Sky. As she sang with passion, the koi chased the horses on land. The hot-blooded heroes turned cold. Jai Tao poured her emotions, expressing herself with fervor, and the runaway noble became the empire's war god, and narrated how the world's perception can be deceptive. Who said those who work in the shadows cannot be heroes? Who said those who stand in the light are all heroes? She spread her arms as her voice carried the weight of their song. With her voice reaching its peak, she delivered. It turned out, this entire world was filled with false heroes, and the story of the false hero happened in another world. Jai Tao, standing boldly before the audience, delivered the song with unwavering conviction. She implored everyone in the audience to not think too much. Despite the performance ending, the audience from the imperial court remained in stunned silence, deeply impacted by the emotional and thought-provoking act. While Tong Fei could not help but assume that Wanner did not intend such a play, she believed that someone else was behind this. At the same time, Xi Long remarked that the play was something like that, believing they made the right choice going there. Zhang Fei was curious about Xi Long's comment, asking what he meant, prompting Liu Bei to explain that the only one who could write such a play was Cheng Dale, and decided to wait and see. On the opposite side of the audience, the crowd of ringers erupted in enthusiastic applause, with ringer giving compliments to them. Another ringer commented that the story was so detailed, asking if it was real. Liu Aji called out Emperor Ming, who was initially unresponsive. Eventually, Emperor Ming acknowledged with a simple compliment, while clapping without much reaction. In a serious face, he then instructed the actors to take a rest, which they confirmed. After instructing the actors, Liu Aji proceeded to make an important announcement, declaring to hear the imperial decree. He announced the name of Yang Longting and Cheng Dale to come forth. Yang Longting smiled as he slowly walked above. Upon his arrival, he knelt in front, while Liu Aji announced the rewards, stating in Yang Longting's name that he would be granted the title of Warlord, Weapons, and Land. Liu Aji continued, acknowledging Cheng Dale's role, stating that he had made great contributions as a general, and he would be granted the title of the Great General of the Northwest. Cheng Dale, in his thoughts, reflected on the irony of the situation, thinking that the play just now mocked Yang Longting, and now they were rewarding him. As he walked to the top, Cheng Dale insulted Emperor Ming as an old foji, suspecting that Emperor Ming intentionally must have done it. Liu Aji then told them to heed Emperor Ming's order, prompting Yang Longting to bow and humbly respond that he dared not receive such a generous reward. Emperor Ming, displaying his wisdom, acknowledged Yang Longting's modesty, saying that Yang Longting had made great contributions to the empire, and that he did not need to be humble since that is what he deserved. However, Yang Longting was filled with determination as he declined the offer, expressing that he was not being humble, as he really felt that he did not deserve it. He continued, saying that he had something that he must say, and hoping for Emperor Ming's forgiveness of his rudeness, to which Emperor Ming let him speak after he stood up, reminding him that there was no need to keep kneeling. Yang Longting began by telling Emperor Ming that he had something that had been on his mind for such a long time, but could not gather the courage to say it. Emperor Ming told him that he should say what he wanted to say, as Yang Longting was also supposed to give a speech that day. Yang Longting then gathered the courage to speak his mind. He began by addressing the reward plentiful, and expressing concern about the condition in Yuzhu which lacked food and people. He remarked that Emperor Ming was not rewarding that, then he requested Emperor Ming for it, and mentioned that he was not asking for it himself but rather asking it for the common people of Yuzhu, remarking their current lives were miserable. With humbleness, Yang Longting declined the rewards, including the title of the warlord, and suggested that someone else deserved it. A concerned person voiced from the crowd, asking about to whom the title should be given. In response to the person, Yang Longting decisively said that it belonged to Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale was taken aback by Yang Longting's decisiveness, cursing him in his thoughts. He believed that Yang Longting was trying to disgust him to the point of death and remarked with a threat that Yang Longting would be dead now. 
Emperor Ming was intrigued by Cheng Dalei's name and mentioned that he had heard of the name before. Yang Longting told the story of a time when Emperor Ming ordered someone to inquire if he knew Cheng Dalei, during which he revealed Cheng Dalei's identity as a mountain bandit, but mentioned that Cheng Dalei swore an oath of life and death with him. He mentioned the battle against the rings, Yang Longting lied, claiming that he only gave commands from the back, while Cheng Dalei was the one facing the front lines. He continued to deceive, stating that Cheng Dalei had suffered a grievous injury in the battle, and he was unable to save him. And since Cheng Dalei passed away, Yang Longting believed that his great name should forever remain in the world, while Cheng Dalei stood at his back. He remarked emotionally that sometimes he wanted to ask for more rewards, but being able to meet someone like Cheng Dalei in his life was more than enough. As the heartfelt words resonated with the audience, the person chimed in again, stating that Yang Longting valued friendship so much. Furrowing his brow in anger, Cheng Dalei thought that Yang Longting was trying to write an apology, so he threatened Yang Longting in his thoughts again as he waited. Liu Aji intervened, telling Emperor Ming that he sent someone to investigate last year, and Yang Longting said that Cheng Dalei died of serious injury. Emperor Ming expressed regret, saying that it was a shame. Yang Longting continued to honor Cheng Dalei's memory, proclaiming that Cheng Dalei sacrificed his body to defend the empire. Dying in the line of duty, his loyalty was paramount, and may his name ring forever. With deep emotion, Yang Longting declared he was alone on earth while Cheng Dalei was alone in heaven. He remarked his regret that in a lifetime, he might never be able to meet him again as he raised his hands above making this heartfelt statement. His voice choked with emotion as he pretended to cry while gazing up at the sky. He continued, saying that Cheng Dalei succeeded, remarking that he only left behind the spirit of a valiant hero. The words carried deep meaning as he implored Cheng Dalei, if he looked down from heaven, asking for guidance to look at the empire that he protected. Emperor Ming urged Yang Longting to stop dwelling on the dead person who could not live again and asked him to stop it now. However, Yang Longting kept his act, kneeling, and making a heartfelt request to Emperor Ming, to reward Cheng Dalei so that his spirit might find rest in heaven. Emperor Ming agreed to reward Cheng Dalei as a hero such as this was a crime against all heroes under heaven. He also requested that Yang Longting should not decline the reward as the empire still needed great generals like himself. Emperor Ming highlighted the importance of nurturing future generations of heroes like Cheng Dalei, remarking that they needed more heroes like Cheng Dalei, recognizing that the empire would never see defeat again. Yang Longting expressed his gratitude to Emperor Ming for his great benevolence. In the next set, Liu Aji instructed Yang Longting that he would personally give Cheng Dalei his seal of military command, prompting Yang Longting to affirm it. Emperor Ming handed the tray of rewards to Liu Aji, signifying the formal granting of honors. As Yang Longting walked over to Cheng Dalei, accompanied by two eunuchs carrying the rewards, he narrowed his eyes as thoughts briefly wandered, noting the brightness of the sun that day. He spoke to Cheng Dalei, remarking that the empire needed a young hero like him. The crowd commented on the reward, starting with the civilian faction hearing rumors that Emperor Ming thought very highly of Cheng Dalei and remarked that he would become a famous general in the future, while the military faction planned to build a close relationship with him, considering that Cheng Dalei was still young and the future was believed to be limitless. In her thoughts, Wenner appeared to be happy as she took pride in having nurtured Cheng Dalei personally. Yang Longting reassured Cheng Dalei that the rest of the empire, and he would also remember his deeds in their hearts, but Cheng Dalei did not respond to him. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei said a different tone as he asserted that there was something he hoped Yang Longting could return to him. Yang Longting looked nervous, asking him what. Cheng Dalei's eyes were filled with anger. He demanded justice, leaving Yang Longting visibly agitated. Fear could be seen in Yang Longting's eyes. As everyone in the world looked for justice, Yang Longting stumbled over his words as he recognized Cheng Dalei and exclaimed that it was him. But the existence of justice in this world remained a question. Cheng Dalei abruptly drew his sword with one hand, grasped it, and struck Yang Longting forcefully, in defense of those who were unjust, using his straightforward sword technique. Everyone's faces were in shock as they witnessed the sudden attack. Only a small trickle of blood emerged from Yang Longting's chest. Realizing that Yang Longting was wearing inner armor, Cheng Dalei quickly closed the distance between them, determination burning in his eyes. Yang Longting, still recovering from the initial attack, saw Cheng Dalei approaching but couldn't react in time. Fear was evident on Yang Longting's face as he was one step away from success. As the silhouette of Yang Longting was forcibly pushed across the platform, he pondered why the future war god of the empire had to be brought down by the current war god of the empire. Cheng Dalei struck Yang Longting in the body once more, causing both of them to tumble out onto the platform. 
His face twisted with anger as he insulted Yang Longting, calling him a coward and demanding his death. With unrelenting vigor, Cheng Dale continued to strike at Yang Longting's armor. He slashed intensely, causing Yang Longting's armor to break, and relentlessly attacked him and managed to slash with his sword, seeing blood in the process, causing blood to splatter on his face while blood seeped from Yang Longting's mouth. As his voice filled with anger, Cheng Dale used his skillful speedy sword explosive fireworks, the final blow of his attack, piercing deep into Yang Longting's chest. Panic spread among the Imperial Guards and spectators, with cries for help over to Yang Longting and calls for the Imperial Guards to intervene. They marched towards Cheng Dale with weapons on them, as Cheng Dale's sword became wet from the blood that pierced Yang Longting's chest. Yang Longting groaned in pain, clutching his injuries. He slowly uttered Cheng Dale's name. Cheng Dale expressed his anger, claiming that it was only fair to take Yang Longting's life after Yang Longting had brought down his village. Yang Longting's eyes narrowed as he pondered who once asked him for fairness in a similar manner. Memories resurfaced, and he mumbled in confirmation that there was someone who asked him for justice like before. He muttered again asking who that man was. He asked himself redundantly who it was as he struggled to envision his face. He then pictured a man with his back turned, standing in front of him. When the man he envisioned glanced at him, he realized it was his friend Han Huju. Yang Longting sighed, dismissing the memory. A man who has cheated the world all his life will be approached by someone sooner or later. Justice is in the heart. The vision of Han Huju faded away. Yang Longting died as he returned to reality, leaving Cheng Dale holding the sword firmly while staring at his lifeless body. The Imperial Guard approached, and the crowd continued to call out Yang Longting's name, with some demanding Cheng Dale be captured alive. On the platform, the civilian and military factions were left in shock. They were unsure of what to say about the event in the Imperial City. Amid the confusion, some still questioned whether Yang Longting was truly dead, while others insisted on his demise, claiming that the Empire had disgraced itself. Jin Wendao recognized Cheng Dale. Meanwhile, Qi Xiang wondered who Cheng Dale was. The weight Cheng Dale carried on his shoulders for a year seemed to dissipate on that day as he stood there, feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. In the midst of the chaotic event, Wanner wondered about the grudge that Cheng Dale held against Yang Longting. With concern in her eyes, she once hoped that Cheng Dale would have a bright future and rise to the top. However, it now seemed that he dragged himself down into the abyss while she watched Cheng Dale being surrounded by the soldiers. Fueled by aggression, the soldiers were relieved that Cheng Dale was still alive. Undeterred by them, Cheng Dale questioned whether they still had the guts to draw their swords, considering that the Ring tribe scared them all out of their wits a year ago. Within the crowd, factions from the military murmured, with one person questioning if he was Cheng Dale, and another person was confused, as it was said that he was dead, wondering why Cheng Dale wanted to kill Yang Longting if they had a good relationship, while others questioned the secrets behind it. Amidst the confusion, Liu Aji sought Emperor Ming's attention, inquiring about the sword in Cheng Dale's hand. Emperor Ming, who observed with a serious demeanor, identified the sword as the sixth artifact common sword. With measured authority, Emperor Ming ordered Cheng Dale to be captured, and if they couldn't capture him, they were to kill him. Slowly, Emperor Ming rose from his seat and told Liu Aji that they were heading back to the palace, with Liu Aji assisting him. As the soldiers surrounded Cheng Dale, one of them urged his fellow soldiers to follow him in avenging Yang Longting, and their comrade who died a year ago. The soldiers' faces showed anger and determination to kill Cheng Dale as they rushed to attack him. Cheng Dale, facing overwhelming odds, engaged to confront the soldiers with remarkable speed and skill. He showcased his martial technique, known as the Teenage Quick Sword, bursting fireworks, causing the guards to be sent sprawling in all directions. Liu Bei saw Cheng Dale and urged the others to go. Liu Bei, Zai Long, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei leaped into action from atop the wall, determined to help Cheng Dale to break through. Unaware of his group's presence, Cheng Dale remained locked in a fierce battle against the soldiers, inflicting wounds that caused the soldiers to creak. Without fear, the soldiers continued to attack, determined to kill, and attempted to surround Cheng Dale, while he responded with his bursting firework technique to block their every move. The soldiers were determined not to let him get away. Yet Cheng Dale, undaunted, skillfully fended them off. With determination in their eyes, the soldiers were relentless in killing Cheng Dale, as they couldn't believe that he had three heads and six arms. Suddenly, on the flip side, Cheng Dale's group initiated a surprise attack on the soldiers from behind. Catching them off guard, some questioned the unexpected intrusion. The sudden attack surprised Cheng Dale, prompting him to turn in that direction. 
Liu Bei with a smirk led the group and announced to Cheng Dalei that they had arrived. While observing the situation below, Tong Fei identified the broken formation. She cursed at Cheng Dalei's group who joined in, and that prompted her to take action. With a swift leap, she descended from above, aiming to intercept the group of Cheng Dalei. Tong Fei sternly warned them, determined to stop their advance. Guan Yu warned them to be careful of Tong Fei's approach, but Xi Long declared that he would take care of Tong Fei on his own. He immediately jumped towards Tong Fei and used his martial technique, the Hundred Dazzling Flowers Jade Phoenix. Their clash resulted in a powerful impact, sending a gust of wind rippling through the area. After the clash, Tong Fei questioned Xi Long's loyalty, believing that Cheng Dalei bewitched him for disregarding their discipleship. Xi Long was determined to seek justice for their fallen comrade and believed he might be able to offend Tong Fei about it. He then looked at his group, reassured them that he would take care of Tong Fei, and urged them to help Cheng Dalei. Liu Bei expressed doubts about whether Xi Long could really beat her, while Xi Long expressed uncertainty, confident that he should be able to. Guan Yu, on the other hand, told Zhang Fei to go there with Liu Bei while he himself would help Xi Long. As Guan Yu and Xi Long charged into action, Tong Fei told them to come, readying herself for the clash. Meanwhile, Zhang Fei and Liu Bei rushed toward Cheng Dalei. While Cheng Dalei continued to fend off the soldiers, one of them exclaimed that he stopped being crazy, while the others continued their relentless assault. In their desperation, one of the soldiers declared that Cheng Dalei could not kill the lightning spear Wen Tailai in his life. Suddenly, a new figure entered, introducing himself as Zhu Xingsheng, the mute scholar of the minister's mansion. With confidence, he challenged Cheng Dalei to taste his move. A soldier remarked that the two masters of the general and the minister's mansion had attacked at the same time, believing that Cheng Dalei couldn't escape, while other soldier commented that this was something that never happened before. However, in an unexpected twist, Cheng Dalei used his bursting fireworks technique to easily dispatch Zhu Xingsheng. The soldier who was looking forward to the fight was shocked, his comical reactions mirroring his face. He remarked that Cheng Dalei must be a monster since the masters of the generals and ministers' mansions were no match for him. Cheng Dalei's thoughts revealed his exhaustion as he employed his martial arts skills repeatedly, yet he was aware there was no hope for a breakthrough. Just as hope appeared to dwindle, Zheng Fei appeared, slicing his way through the soldiers using the technique of catch pigs, sending the soldiers away. Zhang Fei, with determination etched on his face, informed Cheng Dalei that they were there to save him. He informed Cheng Dalei that the breakthrough was on their side, to which he agreed. With their support, Cheng Dalei succeeded in breaking through. As the barracks hunt persisted, determined soldiers urged to hold them, while the other soldiers urged to close the gates, not letting Cheng Dalei and his group break out. Others yelled that there were just three of them, their voices echoed throughout the area. Zhang Fei fought his way through the soldiers, all while asking Cheng Dalei where they were heading. In response to Zhang Fei's question, Cheng Dalei stated that they were heading northwest of the city walls, while he was busy slashing out the soldiers. The soldier desperately alerted everyone that Cheng Dalei and his group were going to the left. Yet Cheng Dalei displayed remarkable skill, breaking through the formation. The soldiers laughed while urging each other to surround and fight him. The soldiers, driven by anger, approached Cheng Dalei and his allies and cornered them, even the actors and actresses who hadn't escaped in time. They called out Cheng Dalei's name, demanding to be paid with his head that day. Suspicion hung heavy in the air as they questioned whether this was a trap or a deliberate gathering of prey. Fear showed on the faces of the allies of Cheng Dalei, while Zhang Fei and Liu Bei seemed anxious and Cheng Dalei maintained a calculated demeanor. Frightened, Jai Tao called out to Cheng Dalei, while Liu Jai held on to her tightly as well as the actors behind them. Cheng Dalei's voice filled with confidence, noted the sunny day, that it was not raining or windy, and hinted at something ominous if they heard about the thunder coming from the ground. Suddenly, an explosion came from the ground, propelling soldiers through the air. Their screams pierced the chaotic atmosphere, some vanished after the explosion, while others were thrown away. Cheng and sewers are well connected, and grave robbers dug through the sewers to the place, and making gunpowder was not difficult. Already a few days ago, the grave robbers required by the fireworks order were everywhere preparing everything. Yanli and Jin Wendao displayed surprise, but Jin Wendao quickly shifted to a wide smile, expressing satisfaction. The soldiers, rattled by the explosion, were left in shock, some moaned in pain. It is uncertain how many Imperial soldiers were injured and suffered broken bones after the entire earthquake. Emerging from the ground after the explosion, Fei Yuan and Kin Man called out to Cheng Dalei, stating that they were there to save him. The soldiers, determined to kill them, rushed forward, trying to see if there was any chance of escape. 
they charged into them resolutely, prompting Kin Man to order Fei Yuan to use a thunderbolt to secure their retreat. Fei Yuan confirmed and activated the bombs. He aggressively taunted the soldiers as if they should eat his stink bombs. After Fei Yuan threw the bombs, the soldiers were rattled, frantically trying to evade them, their fear evident on their faces. As the bombs exploded, a thick cloud of smoke enveloped the area, causing the soldiers to panic. Amidst the chaos, some soldiers were hit and called for help while the others realized that the smoke was filled with toxins. Inhaling the toxins, they coughed in pain, and others succumbed to the deadly effects. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei provided an antidote to Liu Bei and Zhang Fei, and then told the rest of the group to take their antidote, urging them to retreat into the blasted sewers. He also called out to Zai Long and Guan Yu, urging them to stop fighting and that it was time to go. With the situation becoming increasingly dire, Cheng Dalei urged everyone to evacuate before the smoke cleared. The soldiers, realizing the danger, ordered their retreat and prepared their strongbow unit to get into position. The soldier command strained before ordering to shoot. Meanwhile, some members of Cheng Dalei's group were in a hurry, saying they should get into the underground, while others urged them to move quickly and get down. However, one member pointed out that the passage was too narrow. Liu Zhai dashed towards the narrow passage, unaware of the incoming arrow. Zhai Tao, though slightly late in her warning, managed to save Liu Zhai just in time. However, in her heroic act, Jai Tao herself was struck by the arrow, and her face twisted in agony as she endured the pain. Despite her injury, Jai Tao managed to smile through the pain, while Liu Jai looked at her with concern. Cheng Dalei focused on stopping the incoming arrows, shielding them from harm. Frustration welled up within Cheng Dalei as he realized the narrow passage could lead to many people dying if nothing is done. Meanwhile, the soldiers prepared for a second wave, ordering the second unit to shoot. As the arrows filled the sky, Cheng Dalei told the others to hurry up and go, stating that he would stay behind to stop them. Cheng Dalei faced the onslaught of arrows, his determination unwavering as he prepared to deflect them all. In this critical moment, two hearts beat as one. The technique he was about to employ was originally Lu Xiao Feng's one finger. It was a martial art that didn't seek to kill but was mainly for defense, and it was the best technique in the world. With a single stroke, Cheng Dalei deflected all the incoming arrows. Through the integration of the system, it became the ultimate blocking technique. Cheng Dalei blocked all the arrows while his group hurried to escape. Among them, Fei Yuan called out to Cheng Dalei. But Cheng Dalei responded, urging him to go quickly, with a stab arrow from his shoulder. He continued to stand firm and block the arrows, until suddenly, he stopped blocking them, to which the strongbow unit fell silent in shock, their faces confused. Meanwhile, Jin Wendao pondered Cheng Dalei's strength, that he became so strong after a year of absence. Wanner contemplated that Cheng Dalei was no longer the mountain bandit who managed to survive by all means when she first saw him. As Wanner viewed Cheng Dalei from the platform, all arrows surrounded him. She marveled at how he had overcome so many difficult challenges with his strength that day. After Cheng Dalei abruptly stopped, he exhaled heavily as he removed the pierced arrow from his shoulder. Suddenly, a soldier threw a chain and captured Cheng Dalei's hand, declaring triumphantly that he had caught him, to which Cheng Dalei resisted. But the soldier gleefully announced that he had successfully restrained Cheng Dalei, naming him as an evil bandit. The soldier told Cheng Dalei that he couldn't escape as there was already an arrow at the end of his flight. He then encouraged the others to cut Cheng Dalei into pieces. Determination filled the air as the soldiers roared to kill him to avenge Yang Longting, while Cheng Dalei was still trapped by the chain. Cheng Dalei felt helpless as he clenched his teeth and cursed in his thoughts. Suddenly, the system emitted a sudden beep, and there were two orbs present. Another beep followed, but the system remained inactive as she still closed her eyes. Following the continuous beeping, the system's self-test was completed. The next beep showed the system's face, and notified that the damage repair had been completed as well. Another beep was notified that the system's administrator consciously awakened as her eyes slowly opened. And another repeated beep notified the reconstructing shape, and a sudden bright light appeared on her body, as if the system was about to transform. The system, still weakened, called Cheng Dalei's name. The next beep was followed by a bright flash that exploded inside the system, causing the orbs she rested to shatter due to the impact of the reconstruction. Cheng Dalei reacted to it, and he groaned out the pain. The impact of the exploded aura from the system pushed the soldiers away from Cheng Dalei's body. Suddenly, a supreme consciousness awakened and swept across the whole audience with an unparalleled aura. The soldiers were suddenly knocked down, and their bodies were scattered everywhere. Tong Fei's eyes were filled with disbelief as she pondered what just happened. 
all of a sudden, the monk appeared beside Tong Fei, greeting her with Amitabha Buddha. He then inquired Tong Fei about the meaning behind Cheng Dalei's action of bringing down the soldiers. He continued, expressing his disbelief and wondering if what he witnessed was a form of lost martial art. Puzzled, Tong Fei questioned the monk why he was there and if it had something to do with an imperial decree from Emperor Ming. The monk replied that Emperor Ming had tasked him with collecting Cheng Dalei's corpse, but it appeared that Cheng Dalei was not dead yet. Consequently, he decided to arrest Cheng Dalei and put him in prison, awaiting Emperor Ming to deal with him. Throwing back a little, just when Cheng Dalei was beating the royal guards and the prison guards were almost empty, someone expressed that they didn't know how many people were locked up in the Ministry of Heavenly Justice, and also what the kid had done to be locked up in this place. His companion informed him that the kid wanted to seek justice for his father in the Imperial Arts Examination, which ruined Emperor Ming and Yang Longting's mood and the man wondered what kind of injustice had been done to his father that he was pleading for justice. The other answered that the kid's father was the coward of war, Lin Wenchen. The man laughed as he realized who he meant by the coward and stated that he deserved it, while the kid inside the cell was Lin Xiaoyu. Lin Xiaoyu's eyes widened. The guards were taken aback and told to alert the others that someone had broken into the prison, as well as who they were and how dare they break into the heavenly prison. Lin Xiaoyu stood there watching as they yelled and called for somebody. A flag outside his cell with the words seeing through the world as the bearer stated that all creations were born to nourish, and people still complained to God for not being benevolent. The man went on to say that he had not known locusts were all over the world, and that everyone was suffering as a result from the king's servant. According to the old Taoist, humans were born as noble or commoner, with the noble always being favored by heaven. His young disciple added that wealthy life is always up to heaven, and commoners' poverty was punished by heaven. The old Taoist then stated that suddenly a madman sharpened his sword at night, and the star emperor swayed in the wind, and bewildered above. One of the guards at the Ministry of Justice's heavenly prison stated that he had no idea how many people their Ministry of Justice had imprisoned in this prison. His companion stated that everyone must listen to the jailer and that if he wanted them to live, they would. And if he didn't want them to live, they wouldn't, whereas his friend stated that what the jailer says is right. As his entrance made a rumbling noise, a man chimed in, stating that this was the rule of the Ministry of Justice Heavenly Prison. The guards were perplexed at what they saw. As three figures approached them, the guard greeted their lord. One of the guards was puzzled. He had the thought that the prisoner needed three Merlian guards as escorts at this time, and they were Tong Fei, Monk, and Liu Aji. Liu Aji told the guards not to torture the person behind him, and not to treat him badly with only three meals a day, and to let him eat whatever he wanted as long as he didn't go out, as well as to try to meet his other needs. The guard cursed Liu Aji in his head, telling him that instead of this prison, he should take the prisoner to his house and bowed inquiring Liu Aji about the prisoner. Cheng Dalei's body was cuffed inside a box while Liu Aji ordered the guard to put him in a separate cell with the heaviest shackles on him. The guard asked Liu Aji what Cheng Dalei had done, and he replied that he had killed a person. The guard wondered how many people Cheng Dalei killed, while the other assumed it was only a few. After a while, Cheng Dalei sat cuffed inside a cell. His hands and head were both encased in a wooden cuff. Cheng Dalei closed his eyes. Later on his brow furrowed as he remembered a fire. His eyes opened wide. While standing on one of the orbs, he noticed a destroyed orb and a perfect orb and wondered if it was the system space. Cheng Dalei observed without saying a word. The repair had been completed, according to a system notification, and the administrator was back. It then informed him about the body reshaping and the shell breaking. A hand emerged from the shell and Hart came out afterwards. The shells gathered in her back. As Hart fell, the shells formed into wings. Cheng Dalei observed throughout the whole thing. Hart continued to fall as her wings spread. She landed on top of Cheng Dalei and told him he was cute. Hart leaned and called Cheng Dalei boy. She smiled and informed him that she's back. Hart informed him that she had not seen him in a long time. Changing to default dress, according to a notification, Hart was then dressed in a white gown. Cheng Dalei expressed relief that the system had been restored. Hart responded that, after all, he had been running around for a year working on the matter. She informed him that although she had been sleeping for the entire year, she could feel what he was doing. She continued, saying that the first time she woke up, she met him in this empty system space. Hart stated that she had followed his day her whole life and that all of her memories came from him. Cheng Dalei asked Hart if she was really only two years old, and Hart confirmed it. Hart informed him that even if she disappeared a new sprite would be born, and that perhaps the meaning of her existence was muddled along with birth, 
and dissipation. Because she was born in this space, and the meaning of her existence was just a vassal of the system. She went on to say that when she chose to give up, he chose to connect in her life, which is why when he jumped off the cliff that day, she asked him not to hesitate. Hart expressed gratitude to Cheng Dalei. For the first time, she stated, she felt like she was an existence who could be cared about. She went on to say that she may be able to find a higher meaning to her existence that is more valuable than her job as an existence administrator. Cheng Dalei turned as Hart called him. She then asked him if he was willing to continue depending on her, to live and die with her, and to walk in this chaotic world with her. A system notification pooped, inquiring if he wanted to sign into a contract with the system sprite. Cheng Dalei remained silent as he stared at the notification. Cheng Dalei expressed surprise and stated that he did not expect her to say something like that out of the blue, as he did not recall her being so proactive, to which she inquired about what he remembered and his impression of her. Cheng Dalei explained that she was more two-faced, like the kind of people who knock a person with a hammer as soon as they came out, but that was no longer the case. Doubting, he asked if she couldn't be a fake or if he was saving the wrong person, which rendered Hart speechless. Hart blushed as she muttered the word dummy. However, the system indicated that the contract had been signed. The system informed him that the officer's summoning function, as well as the lottery function, and the system store were now open which Hart said now that the system had been completely restored and many functions had become stronger. She told Cheng Dale that he had grown up a lot. Cheng Dale, however inquired if Hart was sleeping where the broken photosphere, to which she replied yes. He inquired about the one intact beside it, and Hart informed him that it was the new system sprite, which had not yet been born. Cheng Dale speculated that there would be two system sprites. Hart informed him that he was right. And because of her, she would be able to hand over the system's maintenance to her, and she would be able to separate herself from the system and follow him to do more things, as well as use her powers without being bound by the system itself. She continued to tell him about her abilities and asked if he was listening. Hart frowned and became enraged. She swung her hand towards Cheng Dalei's head. She slapped his head and told him to listen to what she was saying. Her eyes widened in rage as she told him that what she was saying was important, and that she wondered if he realized what he was up against in the real world. Hart called Cheng Dalei an idiot. She went on to say that it looked like that the sprite would have to work as soon as it awakened and that it was now time for him to leave the place. Hart explained that he had been worried about her for a long time and that she should do something for him, and that there was a chance that he could use his newly acquired sprite power. A system notification appears, stating that Cheng Dalei received a new mission, which stated that the young person who was in prison could only start a new life if they escaped. Cheng Dalei noticed the difficulty and inquired about the reward, but Hart chuckled and said she would keep it a secret for the time being. Cheng Dalei sat in his cell that night. He determined that the shackles must have weighed at least a hundred pounds and wondered if they were afraid of him escaping from prison. A coup was heard outside Cheng Dalei's cell. Cheng Dalei became aware and looked out the window. Bai Feiyuan appeared, addressing Cheng Dalei. He inquired if he was okay. Cheng Dalei assured him that he was fine and inquired about the situation outside. Bai Feiyuan informed him that only those who were wounded and couldn't get out were left in the city, and a group of brothers took care of them while the Empire searched for them. But with his orders, they had quietly evacuated the city and were now settled in Hulu Mountain, which Cheng Dalei was relieved about and told him that if there were casualties, he should leave more silvers for their families as it was all they could do. Bai Feiyuan assured him that they had not suffered many casualties. Cheng Dalei informed him that another brother, Lin Xiaoyua, had been caught and ordered him to find out where he was being held and save him. Bai Feiyuan assured him that he had heard that he had been rescued by a strong warrior, a teacher, and his disciple. Cheng Dalei, concerned, inquired about Yi Jidao and Liu Jihan, wondering if they were okay, to which Bai Feiyuan replied that Liu Jihan was fine, but Su Ying was very worried about him. He went on to say that Yi Jidao was seriously injured, and assured him not to worry because a brother named Liu Bei was treating her. Bai Feiyuan noticed something. He turned around and listened. He informed Cheng Dalei that someone was approaching and assured him that the brothers would certainly save him. Bai Feiyuan then leaped above the prison gate. A clunking noise was heard. The monk walked towards Cheng Dalei's cell. He then turned to face Cheng Dalei and muttered the phrase Amitabha Buddha. Cheng Dalei greeted him and asked what he was doing here. The monk explained that he had naturally come to look after him. Cheng Dalei inquired whether it was necessary, to which the monk replied that it was only because he was too good. Cheng Dalei smiled and told him just because he's too good that he had to look after him as a Buddhist monk, and he wondered if he was praising him or himself. He went on to ask what was his origin, and if he was from the Shaolin Temple. 
He told him that the night had been long and difficult for him to sleep, and because they couldn't sleep, he asked why they didn't just talk, and he informed him that they were peers, and he might not know his name. He told him his name was Cheng Dale, and his master was the South Pole Immortal, and Golden Star Taibai was his sworn brother, and Marshal Tianpeng was his senior brother, and he knew the law of five thunder, and he had a thousand miles of eyes and ears, and could summon the wind and rain. However, Cheng Dale suggested that he would tell him a joke and ask if he knew what men had that women didn't, and told the monk to speak up and not pretend to be cold. Cheng Dale paused and said nothing. He gritted his teeth as he viewed information. He yelled telling the monk to come on. Cheng Dale addressed the man as Meng Jilao and asked if he would still show respect if he saw a real Buddha. A system information appeared, stating Meng Jilao's information, and his dharma's name was Qin Yi, who was 52 years old. Cheng Dale had a thought in his head that he really looked down on him. He then informed Meng Jilao about himself, 52 years old, and his dharma's name was Qin Yi, and he was an infinitely compassionate, and merciful palm, with Vajra indestructible body skill. Meng Jai Lao stared at Cheng Dale. He asked him how he knew that as he had lived in seclusion for many years, and few people around the county knew his name, to which Cheng Dale responded that he had his connections. Cheng Dale stated that he told him that his master was the South Pole Immortal, and what things could he not know, and asked him to have a casual chat, and if he didn't speak again, he would tell him how he peeked at a woman taking a bath when he was a child and how it would affect his public image more. Meng Jilao asked what he was talking about, but Cheng Dale said they could talk about anything, such as his first love. Meng Jilao blushed and stated that he had something unclear and wanted to ask for his advice. Cheng Dale told him to go ahead, believing that it was to ask him why he wanted to kill Yang Longting, and then talk about what injustice, and the sea of suffering later, and so on the truth, and he also thought that he just liked to talk about some life philosophy. Meng Jilao asked again what it was that men had that women didn't. It wasn't that he didn't want to talk. It was just that he had been thinking about the question and asked him not to blame him for being a little rude. Cheng Dale instructed him to look at his beard. And the answer was beard. Cheng Dale had the impression that Meng Jilao was a retarded pervert and asked him what he was thinking or what he believed it was. Meng Jilao stated that he believed it to be Adam's apple. But now he believes he was mistaken, which stunned Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale asked Meng Jilao if he changed his clothes before imprisoning him and said he was very thoughtful because he remembered not wearing this suit before. Meng Jilao chuckled and said he was covered in blood and had a cleanliness fetish, so he naturally needed to help him wash up a bit. He then asked Meng Jilao if he could remove the wooden shackles around his neck, and if he refused, he had to help him relieve himself. Moments later, he stated that it was finally a little easier. According to Meng Jilao, Buddha stated that all beings were suffering, that is, all thoughts were born from the beginning of his obsession, and in one single mind. He went on to say that sometimes you could hold on to it and get nothing, and sometimes you could let go and get more. He then suggested to Cheng Dale that he give it a try. Cheng Dale told him to fuck off, saying that the last time he cheated him out of a steam bun, and he would never give him today's baked cake. Cheng Dale realized that Meng Jilao had been here for 12 hours. He cursed him, saying he robbed him of his food. He realized he wouldn't be able to escape from prison if he didn't get rid of Meng Jilao. He asked Meng Jilao why bad people become Buddhas simply by putting down the butcher's knife, whereas good people had to get through 9,981 difficulties to become Buddha. Meng Jilao responded stating that Buddha did not say so, however Cheng Dale let out a scoff. He told him that he had heard about a virgin woman who was very devoted to women's virtue, and that the imperial court had even issued her chastity arch for women. He claims that after her death, everyone found something under her pillow. Cheng Dale smirked and challenged Meng Jilao to guess what was under her pillow, to which Meng Jilao struggled to respond. Meng Jilao chanted Amitabha Buddha's name and said that color was empty, and empty was color, and asked Cheng Dale to behave himself. Cheng Dale told him that he saw a monk on the road begging for alms, and he knew exactly what he wanted before he opened his mouth, and he wondered if it was called element perception. Meng Jilao responded that his words had profound meaning. Cheng Dale asked him if he thought the Tathagata Buddha or the Jade Emperor fought badly, however, Meng Jilao just told him not to say such things. Cheng Dale wondered if he knew or had heard of such a Buddha since he knew Buddha so well, and Meng Jilao asked him to tell him. He wondered if Meng Jilao had heard of a Buddha named Namo Gatling Bodhisattva in the far west who had 3,600 bullets per breath, and was the Buddha of great compassion and mercy, to which Meng Jilao replied that he had not. Cheng Dale went on to say that there was also a Buddha named Ultraman, who stood 40 meters tall. 
weighed 35,000 kilograms and was 20,000 years old. He also told him about Namo Infinite Heat Buddha, Namo Infinite Power Buddha, and Namo Infinite Entropy Buddha, as well as Namo Heat Silence Great Bodhisattva, Namo Nuclear Fission Buddha, and Namo Nuclear Fusion Buddha, and asked Meng Jilao if he had heard of any of them. Meng Jilao stated that Cheng Dalei was a great person with great wisdom, and that his Buddhist attainment was so low that he didn't know so many Buddha names. But Cheng Dalei simply laughed at him. With doubts of life, Meng Jilao requested Cheng Dalei to enlighten him, and that as a Buddhist, he was not as good as he was in Buddhist ways. Cheng Dalei requested an answer first, asking what Emperor Ming's plan was now, and why he allowed Meng Jilao to guard him every day. Meng Jilao stated that on the 14th of July was the Olambana, the opening of the Ghost Gate. He went on to say that it was suitable for releasing river lanterns, and mourning the deceased, and also remembering old lovers. Meng Jilao also stated that the most evil villains, such as a devil like him, should be executed in front of the entire world. He told Cheng Dalei that his execution would be by lynching by 360 swords. Meanwhile, at Waiyang Palace in the Imperial City, Emperor Ming had thought that Jiangnan had only received half of the Imperial grain this year because it had been flooded due to continuous heavy rain. And, according to information he received from the Merlian Guard, the Yangtze River had favorable weather that year, with no disasters. He also claimed that the Northwest Army needed food, that horse bandits were rampant, and that they needed a lot of food to fight bandits. As Emperor Ming read reports, Princess Minju kneeled in front of him. Without saying a single word, Princess Minju looked down. Emperor Ming ordered her to go back. However, Princess Minju begged him. Emperor Ming was aware of her being there and asked her not to say anything. He stated that she was not only his daughter but also the princess of the empire, and she must not say anything in court. Princess Minju advised Emperor Ming that Cheng Dalei did not deserve to die. She bowed to Emperor Ming, stating that he also mentioned that Cheng Dalei was an outstanding talent of the empire, and that his life was far more valuable than his death. She went on to say that Cheng Dalei made great contributions to the empire but killed the hero, and that treacherous court officials were running amok at that time. She was afraid that it would make people in the world cold, and that if things continued, the Lai family would lose its value. Emperor Ming inquired why she wanted to save him, and if he was the man she wanted to marry. Princess Minju frowned and told Emperor Ming that Cheng Dalei was just a friend to her. Emperor Ming, on the other hand, stated that the imperial family does not have friends. In Chang'an City, even fowls and dogs were not left in peace those days, but it can also be said everything was quiet. The angry Yuzhu soldiers raided, and the city's peddlers and carriers were arrested, at a time when the wind was cranky, and the prison was overcrowded. But, most of Cheng Dalei's people had already withdrawn, and those who failed to withdraw were hidden and were the last to suffer. Only those powerless ordinary people were caught at some point at the brothel, the full fragrance house. Soldiers pointed spears at the girls, told them not to move and to be honest. One of them stated that he suspected they were harboring a traitor, Yi Jidao. An elderly woman informed them that they were running an honest business, that Yi Jidao was no longer present, and that they severed ties with her. However, the official ordered his men to search. He went on to say not to miss a single place because Yi Jidao must have left a clue. A vase was thrown next to the girls, scaring them. A soldier informed his officer that the search was over and no trace of Yi Jidao had been found. The officer gave the order to arrest all of the women as he would interrogate them that night, believing they must have some information. The soldiers surrounded the women, advising them to tell them where they had hidden Yi Jidao and that if they didn't, they would have to take them back for proper interrogation and one chuckled, telling them to behave themselves and come with them. A voice ordered the soldiers to let go of the women. The officer scoffed, asking who was so daring as to stop their Yuzhu army from arresting the murderer who assassinated Yang Longting. Tong Fei sat and closed her eyes. The officer recognized Tong Fei and informed her that it was the responsibility of their Yuzhu army, and that the Merlian guards could not interfere. Tong Fei asked what an investigation had to do with the girls and informed them that, as far as she knew, Yi Jidao was seriously injured and that the rebels had hidden her somewhere for treatment. She went on to say that instead of investigating the medicine shop and searching the dangerous underground city, they were making things difficult for these helpless women. The officer inquired what it had to do with her, stating that they had to be involved with Yi Jidao, and that the Merlian guards couldn't control them. Tong Fei stated that three days after Yan Longting's assassination, they searched for three days, turned the casinos, brothels, and tea houses upside down, and many people were arrested, and a lot of profit was scrapped. Tong Fei claimed that the Yuzhu army committed crimes in Chang'an in the name of avenging Yang Longting. 
She went on to say that Emperor Ming turned a blind eye to it in order to allow them to vent their anger, and now they wanted to take innocent women and spoil them. She asked if they truly believed the Merlian guards were blind. The officer chuckled and told his subordinates they were leaving because Yi Jidao was not in the place. Kong Fei responded that she was just doing her job when the elderly woman thanked her for saving their lives. She warned the women that because Chang'an was in chaos, they should take care of themselves, for which the girls thanked her. Kong Fei frowned. She thought in her head that a few true villains were caught, but innocent people suffered, and she didn't know how many people filled their pockets and eradicated dissidents during the search progress. There were 150,000 city guards in Chang'an, and 30,000 imperial guards in the imperial city. She wondered if they were letting them run amok in Chang'an just to appease the anger of those soldiers and generals. She wondered what Emperor Ming was thinking of putting the people at risk for the sake of the so-called balance. Xiao Yi walked down the street somewhere. A group of soldiers passed by and talked about what the point of investigating a pharmacy was when there was little profit from it, while the officer responded by asking if they were really going to listen to that woman and investigate the medicine shop. Xiao Yi overheard their conversation. She ran while one of the soldiers suggested they go to the casino and play a few games. Xiao Yi continued to walk. She looked around before entering a small house deep in the alley. She knocked on the door. As she entered, she informed Su Ying about the medicine. Su Ying thanked her before cautioning her not to get the medicine from the same medicine shop because they needed a lot of herbs. Xiao Yi told her not to worry because she had been buying medicine from a different medicine shop, to which Su Ying replied that she had done well. She asked Liu Bei how Yi Jidao was doing and Liu Bei replied that her pulse had stabilized, but she still needed to recuperate for a few days before getting out of bed. Su Ying stated that she would leave it to him to change the medicine because she was leaving and needed to discuss with the brothers how to save Cheng Dale, and he needed to take care of Yi Jidao. Remember this from now on, someone said. The elderly woman informed the girls that they were no longer associated with Yi Jidao, and she stated that there was no longer a person named Yi Jidao here. One of the girls questioned whether it wasn't too ruthless to treat Yi Jidao like that. The woman responded that Yi Jidao had colluded with criminals to cause chaos and that if they didn't draw a line between them, they would all die. And she knew the girls had deep affection for her, but if they acted up again, she asked them not to blame her for being ruthless. When the woman walked away, the girls asked where she was going. She told them not to be nosy and to go do whatever they should be doing when she realized Yi Jidao had caused a lot of trouble this time. She reasoned that she did not receive even a cent of redemption money and suffered a big loss this time. After all, the woman thought Yi Jidao was top grade good, and she didn't believe she didn't have anything valuable hidden away. She muttered that she found it after throwing some of Yi Jidao's belongings. The woman, who was holding a lot of jewelry, stated that Yi Jidao was worthy of being their top artisan, and she actually had so many valuables hidden away. Her eyes sparkled, and her mouth drooled, muttering that it was all hers now. Upset, the woman wondered where the music notes were hidden, and how many Yi Jidaos she could nurture as long as she had those notes. Meanwhile, an eye peered through the hole in the wall where the woman was. One of the girls noticed what was going on inside. Disappointed, the girl sat down. The girl sobbed, wondering if Yi Jidao would really not come back. Back from ten days ago, the girl asked Yi Jidao if she was leaving. Yi Jidao asked her what kind of expression she had, and she was just going out to act in a play. However, the girl doubted. The girl responded that this time felt different than before, and she had a feeling that once Yi Jidao left this time, she wouldn't come back. Yi Jidao assured her that she would be back soon, and the girl insisted that she should let her come with her. She asked Yi Jidao if she was going to leave her. Yi Jidao handed her a paper and asked her to take it, because it was written there how to contact the people on that side, as well as the secret code, address, and contact person, and she asked her to hide it, and she couldn't let her mother see it and as long as she brought her seal with her, the people there would help her. She went on to say that if she couldn't come back, the paper would help her find her. The girl held the paper Yi Jidao had given her. Meanwhile, Su Ying stated that they would leave once Cheng Dale was rescued. Someone inquired if she was sure they could rescue him. Su Ying responded that it must be done regardless of the certainty, and that none of their plans had a 100% chance of succeeding. And it was no different this time. She asked Yi Jidao if she had thought about what she wanted to do in the future. Yi Jidao responded that she no longer had a place in Chang'an. She was unsure where she should go next. Su Ying offered her the opportunity to leave together with them. She asked Yi Jidao if she wanted to join their toad village. Yi Jidao inquired if it was okay. She went on to say that she had once heard Liu Jihan talking about what happened to Toad Village, and that they even destroyed the 100,000 Ring Clan army, claiming that they were all heroes of the Empire, while she was just a brothel girl. 
Su Ying reassured her, saying they were actually a group of bandits. They were interrupted by a knock on the door. Su Ying advised Yi Jitao to lie down first because someone was coming, and she would open the door. She asked who it was. Bai Feiyuan greeted Su Ying, who inquired as to who he had come with. Bai Feiyuan informed her that the girl had contacted them through the informant they had left behind for emergencies, and that she was an acquaintance of Yi Jitao. The girl inquired as to whether Yi Jitao was present. Su Ying asked Bai Feiyuan if anyone had followed him, to which he replied that he took a huge detour before bringing the girl over, and he even blindfolded her eyes, to which Su Ying told them to get in quickly. Yi Jidao inquired of the girl how she found this place, and the girl asked why she was hurt and what happened to her. The girl informed her that she found this place by following the directions she left on the paper. She went on to say that there were a lot of soldiers looking for her outside. Bai Feiyuan warned them that they didn't have much time and that if they needed to say something to each other, they should do so quickly. The girl mentioned Yi Jidao, crying. She stated that she wanted to leave with her. Yi Jidao asked her what she was saying. She informed her that she was currently a fugitive and that if she went with her, her life would be in danger as well. The girl, on the other hand, argued that she didn't care because she wanted to stay with her. She went on to say that their mother had taken all of her valuables and had even hired people to look for her. Yi Jidao responded that it seemed like something she would do. Because she didn't want to stay there, the girl insisted on taking her with her. However, Yi Jidao shook her hand and declined and said that her life was at least guaranteed as long as she stayed there. She hugged the girl and told her that as her sister, she no longer had a place in Chang'an, to which the girl asked why she had to go to the play. She stated that if she hadn't gone, she wouldn't be this way right now. Yi Jidao told her that she was born as a courtesan and entertained people as a way of living and that her own feelings were never taken into consideration, and that she was merely a plaything for those with power and money. Because what she had was so little, she stated that she must give back even the smallest favors that she owed, and even if it cost her life. She took a book, and told the girl that it was the musical score given to her by her benefactor. She stated that she was definitely able to stand above the rest, and that when the time came, she would be able to redeem herself and live as a free person, to which the girl inquired if it was her most valuable possession. Yi Jidao told her it was all right because she wouldn't have to use it in the future, told her to take it and leave quickly, and asked her not to find her anymore in the future. The girl cried and still insisted. Yi Jidao advised her that she should leave now. She stated that if the place were exposed, they would all die. The girl wiped her tears. Yi Jidao looked at the girl as she left. She sobbed, thinking that there were no longer people named Yi Jidao and Chang'an. Su Ying ordered Bai Feiyuan to send the girl back, to which he said yes. The girl asked Su Ying to look after Yi Jidao, and Su Ying asked if that was her gift to her. She advised her not to play it in the near future because it would expose their relationship with Yi Jidao. The girl bowed and thanked Su Ying, saying that she would take her reminder to heart. The girl was escorted by Bai Feiyuan. Su Ying frowned but said nothing. Yi Jidao approached her and apologized. She went on to say that it was her mistake that she gave the emergency contact to someone else. Su Ying told her not to dwell on that, but they couldn't leave their safety to whether the girl could keep the secret or not. She inquired as to whether she made a decision. Yi Jidao paused for a moment. She blushed as an image of Cheng Dalei flashed through her mind and replied yes. Su Ying informed her that they were going to pack up and leave because they needed to regroup with the rest of the group. So Yi Jidao agreed. The next morning, the officer ordered his men to surround the place and not let the criminals escape. The soldiers stormed through the gate. The officer's eyes darkened, and the courtesan mother stood beside him. Hulani began by stating that the contract terms were negotiated, and they were in Chang'an City for a long time, so it was time for them to return. He also asked them to prepare the compensation, goods, and so on for them, and they would leave in a few days. Lin Leshen wished them all a good trip and expressed his desire to share a glass of wine with them in the future. Hulani responded that he thanked him for his kindness and that, as an eternal heaven descendant, he would always remember their friendship. Lin Leshen got the impression that the rings were in Chang'an for so long that they picked up on imperial hypocrisy as well. Suddenly, Hulani mentioned Lin Leshen. He wondered if the Empire would send them a princess, hoping she would marry into the grassland and become a symbol of friendship between their two clans. Lin Leshen was taken aback. He simply laughed it off and asked Hu Lani if he was joking. He informed Hu Lani that the princess grew up with mutual respect, wild and spirited, and he feared that marrying one of them off to the grasslands would not only harm, but also destroy their friendship. Hulani retorted that women like Princess Minji were better suited to life in the grasslands and that true warriors preferred reckless steeds over well-behaved sheep. 
Lin Leshen, on the other hand, argued that he was afraid that the prince was unaware that the princess already had a marriage contract, and that allowing the king of the grasslands to marry a woman with a marriage contract would be disrespectful to the king. Hulani chuckled and told him that the steppe dwellers didn't care and questioned who didn't love beautiful women, and that only the strongest men deserved to have them. Lin Leshen explained that Princess Minji was Emperor Ming's favorite daughter, and if he married her off in the meadow, his father would find it difficult to bear the longing. Hulani argued that marrying off Princess Minji to the grassland would prove the friendship between the two sides and wondered if the empire was about to marry off an insignificant woman to the grasslands. The two looked into each other's eyes and read the murderous intent of each other in their smiles. Hulani thought that if he didn't give Princess Minji to him, he would beat him up. Even though he wove himself a dazzling garment of false friendship, humble wisdom, and camouflaged victory, but when he opened his robe, under the robe was still a thin, bony, frail, and crippled body. The building would collapse, and the landscapes would crumble. The thin hands trembled. Someone stated that there was no diplomacy in a weak country. Then a voice yelled, saying they wanted their Princess Minjiu. Emperor Ming, enraged, threw something and wondered how he negotiated with them. He described Lin Leshen as a loser who couldn't get anything done. He went on to say that he told them not to even think about it, and that only fools dreamed about it, to which Lin Leshen responded that he was incompetent and did not do his job properly. Lin Leshen proceeded to inform him, and Emperor Ming inquired as to what the barbarians said. Lin Leshen informed him that they expressed their willingness to give up the three cities they occupied as a gift from the grasslands in order to welcome Princess Minju, and he paused before saying if they did not agree. He went on to say that they would grab her themselves. Emperor Ming challenged to let them come because he was a king of a country, and he couldn't even protect his own daughter. Lin Leshen stared at his father as blood poured from his head. He wondered how long anger lasted, whether for 15 minutes or for a flame of incense. He clenched his fists and addressed Emperor Ming. The candle illuminated the room. Lin Leshen informed Emperor Ming that the empire could not afford to fight this battle. Civilian officials and military generals at the Chang'an court fought to the death and regarded Emperor Ming as a clay statue, while the southern nobility enjoyed their lives in luxury, and the northern people raised troops and bought horses. Indeed, that today's empire could not afford to fight this battle, as Emperor Ming appeared depressed. The emperor, like the civilians under the iron heel of the rings, could only stand by and watched as his wives and daughters were humiliated. An image of Cheng Dalei's side appeared through the defeated emperor, who gave up hope. Meanwhile at the penitentiary department heavenly prison, Cheng Dalei sat on a pile of hay, while Meng Jilao sat on the other side of his cell. He closed his eyes and rested his hand on the back of his head. He saw two orbs, one of which was destroyed. Hart wondered if it was the right time to do it because he was about to be lynched and still thinking about playing. Cheng Dalei replied, wondering as to what he was supposed to do against Meng Jilao who guarded the door every day, and he couldn't even defeat him, and if he didn't go, he wouldn't stand a chance, he placed a pair straight K. The lottery machine appeared distressed but said nothing. He said rocket, to which Hart and Cheng Dalei both replied that they couldn't afford it. Cheng Dalei kept a diary of what happened during his time in prison. Two prison guards sat facing each other. When a group of people arrived, both guards stood there greeting them, and the Lord told them to pass the order down. Liu Aji ordered them to clean up the place and transfer all the prisoners to other jails, and also got rid of all the dirt, muck, grime, and bad smells, and he wanted the place to be spotless. The soldiers cleaned up the prison quickly. Cheng Dale observed what was going on and wondered what they were doing. Then suddenly his cell opened. Tong Fei was the one who welcomed him and towered over him. Cheng Dale inspected the information, perplexed. Tong Fei told him to stand up and be good, and not to make any unnecessary movements. Tong Fei's information stated that she was 25 years old and had monstrous strength, which Cheng Dale was surprised by because of another peerless level martial artist. Cheng Dale made an abrupt soft noise. He didn't say anything while observing. Then a bowl of food was served. Foods with a wafting fragrance were placed outside of his cell, as he wondered if the execution date had been brought forward and it was his last meal. He thought that maybe Emperor Ming thought that dragging out the execution date was too cruel, and wanted to give him a few days of enjoyment before he was executed. Cheng Dale sighed and stated that as the moon turned from crescent, and the skies of blossoms, he couldn't help but reminisce, but it turned out that he was a person that no one loved or missed. In his cell, he extended his hand to grab a cup. Struggling, he thought he couldn't reach it. His face darkened. Then, as Cheng Dale looked on, Emperor Ming filled his cup, and he proceeded to fill Cheng Dale's cup. Emperor Ming just stared and said nothing. 
the current emperor rose to the throne at a young age and soon learned one thing, to never let other people know what you were thinking about. He had always looked at the people around him with a cold and calculative gaze, and looking at them put on their little facade, looking at them flailing about, and looking at them playing their dirty little tricks. No one could ever guess what he was thinking or perhaps not thinking. Cheng Dalei observed Emperor Ming. He wondered why his entire family was so into cosplay and if their ancestors had gotten mixed up with some weirdos. Meanwhile, at the princess's residence, a hand grabbed a piece of clothing and yelled no. Princess Minju threw a pillow at Lin Leshen, claiming she didn't want to. Lin Leshen told her not to be agitated and informed her that the Grassland King was a hero of the Ring tribe, whom she had always adored. Princess Minju retorted that if he thought the king was so good, he should have married him. Lin Leshen laughed and told her to stop joking informing her that they already rejected Wan Huan and Yula in favor of her, and they were even willing to use three cities as a dowry. He said that their princess Minju was kind, beautiful, smart, and knowledgeable, and that everyone claimed her beauty was worth a city, but what's one city compared to three? To which Princess Minju told him to scram. Princess Minju informed him that she told him she didn't want to marry, and if he kept trying to force her, she would hang herself. To which Lin Leshen replied that if she hanged herself, her tongue and eyeballs would fall out, and she would turn into an ugly ghost. She threatened to cut her wrist, and he explained how painful it was and how she wouldn't have been able to endure the pain. She said she'd jump into a river, to which he replied that the water would turn her into a bloated corpse, but Princess Minju insisted on starving herself. Lin Leshen surrendered and sighed. He told her that she had already grown up. Princess Minju frowned as she addressed Lin Leshen, but Lin Leshen cut her off and said that sometimes, adults had to do things they didn't want to do. Lin Leshen walked away. She yelled at him that she was not going to get married. Lin Leshen stopped and told her that she must. Princess Minju was left alone after Lin Leshen left. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Princess Minju realized that it wasn't a fight between siblings, and it wasn't like when she was younger and screamed that she didn't want to learn the dulcimer. Back when Princess Minju, when she was younger, made silly faces, and even if she were to slice the board apart with a sword, her brother would only tell her. Lin Leshen stated it was alright and that they weren't going to learn that day, but she couldn't slack off tomorrow. Now that Princess Minju had grown up, she realized that there were things that couldn't be solved by cutting it with a sword. And as the princess of the empire, she had responsibilities that she had to fulfill, even if she didn't want to. The torches illuminated the dim dungeon. Emperor Ming asked Cheng Dale why he wasn't drinking and if he thought it were poisoned. Cheng Dale responded. He stated that a glass of wine for the driver resulted in two rivers of tears for their loved ones, leaving Emperor Ming speechless. Emperor Ming stated that it was his first time finding out that Chang'an had a big brother protecting it, and that it turned out he was the one shielding him from rain and wind. And Princess Minju had already told him something about him, as well as the reason why he had the sixth prince's sword. Cheng Dale advised him that sometimes you needed to make a persona for yourself when moving about. Emperor Ming laughed and said that he was just like how Princess Minju described, always saying things that others couldn't understand. He informed Cheng Dale that he would be executed on July 17th and asked him if he wanted to say anything to him before he died. To which Cheng Dale asked if he was looking to chat with him because the nights were too long and he couldn't sleep. Emperor Ming pondered and said yes. He stated that ever since he sat on that throne, he never once heard anyone tell him the truth. He went on to say that he controlled all under heaven, and the lives of all those who lived under it belonged to him. He told Cheng Dale he shouldn't worry about his life, since he was about to die, and that maybe only he was willing to speak a few true words to him. He inquired of Cheng Dale whether he was really not drinking. Emperor Ming inquired whether Cheng Dale was unwilling to speak with him, but he received no response. Cheng Dale requested that if he could push the cup a little closer so he could actually touch it, maybe he would drink a few cups. The two stared at each other awkwardly. Emperor Ming informed him that he spent his life reading people's intentions. However, he held him in disdain. Enraged, Emperor Ming asked Cheng Dale if he thought of him as a puppet ruler. Cheng Dale had a thought in his head telling Emperor Ming not to get angry because he was not especially talented either, and he simply happened to transmigrate. Emperor Ming retorted that Cheng Dale thought of him as an idiot as well. He informed him that ever since he was born, he was already scheming against heaven. He was born a royal and rose to the crown on an unstable throne, and ever since he was little, he had to scheme against his parents, his ministers, various nobles, and he even had to scheme against his daughter. He stated that if they all thought he was an idiot and lofty sitting in his position, blind and deaf to everything that was going on, 
They all thought he couldn't tell the truth from lies, a puppet emperor that anyone could make a fool of. Cheng Dalei said nothing. Emperor Ming added that Lin Wentian fought to the last breath, and yet he was executed like a dog on the streets. And Yang Longting ran from battle, yet was hailed as the god of war. He questioned him if he truly believed he didn't know all of those things and stated that he knew them all for a year. Cheng Dalei asked why he didn't do anything about it if he was already aware of it. Emperor Ming informed him that the empire suffered a crushing defeat, an absolute loss. As he stated, the empire needed someone to bear the name of a sinner, so Lin Wentian had to fill the role. Yang Longting became the war god because the empire needed someone to give them hope. He went on to say that he knew Lin Wentian since he was a kid, and that they used to ride horses in the fields and spar in the sand pit. And the night before he was beheaded, he sat down with him and had a meal like this, and that night, he sat where he was now, and they both got drunk, and before he left, he told him not to be sad, Emperor Ming said. Emperor Ming explained that everyone had their own roles, that he had his job as the emperor and Princess Minju had a role as the princess and that they couldn't escape destiny. He told Cheng Dalei that he did nothing wrong and even made great contributions to the empire. Emperor Ming stated that, however, he should not have killed Yang Longting, and the empire needed someone to take the blame now that the person who everyone looked up to for hope had died. He told him that was why he had to die for the sake of the nation and its people. Cheng Dalei paused and said nothing. He sighed. He gave Emperor Ming the middle finger and told him to go fuck himself. Outside of Chang'an, significant items like cosmetics, silk, spices, and weapons were traded. The rings brought carts of valuable items back to the grasslands as if they were explorers returning with treasures from ancient ruins. With a warm display of hospitality, Lai Leshen conveyed to the ring tribe that he could only accompany them until there. In a gesture of respect, Lai Leshen hoped for a short and smooth journey for the ring tribe. He extended his wishes for their friendship between their two nations. Yanli and Jin Wendao showed equal respect to Lai Leshen and, in response, they vowed their descendants would remember their friendship with the Empire. They would treasure it like warriors treasured their blades. A smile formed on Yanli's face as he continued, affirming that they would wait for Wanner, emphasizing her role as the symbol of peace between their two nations. Lai Leshen affirmed the sentiment with a contemplative look. He acknowledged the undeniable truth since without Wanner, there would be no peace. As they were about to part ways, Jin Wendao sought information from Lai Leshen regarding the Empire's plans to deal with Cheng Dalei. Lai Leshen explained that Cheng Dalei was a citizen of their empire and naturally would face punishment under the Empire's laws for his crimes. Jin Wendao acknowledged it. Jin Wendao inquired further and asked for a favor concerning the proper burial of Cheng Dalei after his execution. In exchange for this request, the Ring tribe offered to owe him a favor. But Lai Leshen responded with a question as he sought clarification that he thought the Rings would hate Cheng Dalei. This prompted Jin Wendao to reply that, as enemies, they couldn't wait to kill him, but as soldiers, they couldn't help but respect him. Jin Wendao made another request for a message to be passed to Cheng Dalei, emphasizing that every single warrior of the Northern Ring tribe had spared no effort to try and kill him, but at the same time, he has their tribe's utmost respect. Lai Leshen assured them that they need not worry since they had accepted their friendship and ensured that Cheng Dalei got a proper burial. Then the Ring tribe departed from Chang'an. Meanwhile, in another part of the palace, a cup of rice shattered as it was flung with force. Inside, Wanner's frustration was evident as she aggressively ordered the maids to leave, making it clear that she was not eating. The maids lowered their heads, obediently carrying a tray into the room. Wanner's discontent was palpable as she pouted and expressed her dismay, crossing her arms. Suddenly, Lai Leshen appeared in Wanner's room and ordered the two maids to leave first, to which the maids confirmed. Concerned, Lai Leshen inquired why she refused to eat, having heard that she starved herself. In response, an angry Wanner told him to get out, saying that he wasn't welcome. But Lai Leshen detected a familiar scent in the room, which he promptly identified as the aroma of the Osmanthus cake from the royal kitchen. He reminded Wanner that eating too many sweets would make her fat. However, Wanner simply turned her head and pouted, feeling embarrassed because she was caught, and said that she didn't want to go to the grasslands, regardless of what Lai Leshen said. Lai Leshen sat down at her side and asked for her attention, asking if she believed he would ever do anything to hurt her. He gave her assurance, saying that once she went there, she would be above tens of thousands of people, and even he himself would bow if he ever saw her in the future. However, when Wanner contemplated his words, she asked if he would still be able to see her in the future. Lai Leshen smiled and replied with conveying a heartfelt message that the sky was high, and the oceans were wide, 
but no matter where she went, she would always be his sister. In a serious tone, Wanner asked Lai Leshen if Xing Zai would also marry her off to the grasslands if he were present. Lai Leshen, whispering calls Xing Zai's name, began to respond, but Wanner cut him off, stating that Xing Zai would never do that. Wanner stood up from her seat and declared that Xing Zai would wield his sword and fight for the ring, even if it meant dying on the battlefield. She firmly believed that Xing Zai would never marry her off to the rings. She told Lai Leshen that, despite being elegant, well-mannered, and skilled in both the pen and sword, she wasn't their father's favorite child. Even though Xing Zai was mischievous and face scolding, deep down, he was everyone's favorite. Comparing Lai Leshen to Xing Zai, Wanner pointed out that the two of them were different. Lai Leshen responded that Xing Zai was gone, and even if he were present, he couldn't change the decision. While looking sad and lost in thought, he realized that Xing Zai couldn't change it either. Emperor Ming suddenly entered Wanner's room, and he looked at the two of them. Lai Leshen quickly stood up and respectfully greeted Emperor Ming, while Wanner pointed at Lai Leshen and complained that he had been bullying her. Emperor Ming cleared his throat before he spoke and told Wanner that Lai Leshen wasn't bullying her, and he actually ordered him to come. With teary eyes, Wanner asked why Emperor Ming could bear to send her to the grasslands and said that she didn't want to leave his side. Without saying a word, Emperor Ming, with a heartbroken expression, reached out his hand toward Wanner's face but withdrew it. He told Wanner that the matter had already been set in stone, and in three days, under the protection of the Merlian guards, she would be escorted to the grasslands to be wed to the grassland king, which left Wanner's face filled with disbelief. Miserable, Wanner cried bitterly, and she told Emperor Ming that it felt like she was being sent to her death. With pain in his eyes, Emperor Ming explained to her that being born into the royal family meant that many things were not within her control to decide. He reached out to wipe the tears from Wanner's eyes and told her that she was not only his daughter, but also the princess of the empire. But Wanner avoided him. Emperor Ming explained that the empire didn't have the strength to engage in a conflict with the rings, and they needed time for the people to recover. He told Wanner that she alone, they could live in peace for five years, and hundreds of thousands of lives would be saved because of her. And within these five years, the Ang Empire could regain its strength, and they would no longer have to suffer defeats from the Ring tribe's attacks. As Wanner looked at Emperor Ming while she was crying, she realized that his entire head had turned gray. She wiped her tears using the cloth of her dress, and with a sudden seriousness, she told Emperor Ming that she could go, but she requested that he promise her one thing. She wanted Cheng Dalei to be released, and Emperor Ming quickly asked her what if he wouldn't agree. Wanner responded by saying she would rather die. But Emperor Ming also asked her if Cheng Dalei was important to her because if he didn't die, the people's hearts could not be put to rest. However, Wanner simply responded that it was his problem and had nothing to do with her. This was not her acting play and childish hobby, asking for something from her father. This was a formal exchange. Using one item to exchange for another, while you don't want to lose either, you can only have one. Emperor Ming looked at Wanner seriously and realized that she had grown up. Those born into the royal family have no choice but to accept their fate. Amidst the dimly lit ambience of Fu Man Lu restaurant, which specialized in roast goose, Shenji thanked Zhu for what he did for them that time. In response, Zhu reassured them that there was no need to worry as Cheng Dale was once done a favor by him, and that Cheng Dale was facing trouble. He couldn't just ignore them. Curious, Shenji inquired about the current situation outside. Kin Man informed him that he heard from the people outside that the Imperial Court was going to execute Cheng Dale on July 14th on Zhu Quest Street. Worried, Su Ying voiced her concerns about the impending execution date and questioned what actions they should take. Shenji's determination was palpable in his response, contemplating their next steps to rescue Cheng Dalei in the Imperial Court while biting his nails in anxiety. Meanwhile, Su Ying looked sad as she pondered that a few hundred people wanted to rebel against Cheng and city and emphasized that more than a hundred thousand troops. She also noted that she often heard Cheng Dalei say that Shenji was wise and resourceful. It seemed that he did not work with him for the first time, as Cheng Dalei said. Kin Man, feeling a sense of hopelessness, feared rescuing Cheng Dalei from inside the Imperial Court. Su Ying, unable to contain her distress, asked Kin Man for his opinion. Kin Man was resolute in his determination that they must rescue Cheng Dalei inside the prison. While Zhang Fei emphasized the importance of reaching out to their comrades as they rescued Cheng Dalei and escaped from Chang'an, their eagerness showed as they clenched their jaws and fists. As the group huddled, Zhang Fei remarked on the similarity of heroes thinking alike, while Shenji led the discussion on the rescue plan. He suggested the daring idea of infiltrating the palace and kidnapping Emperor Ming to use as a bargaining chip for Cheng Dalei. 
Tin Man chimed in suggesting that they could go late at night and take Cheng Dalei by surprise. Zhang Fei supported the plan, but Su Ying watched them with distress. Anxiety was visible on Su Ying's face as she struggled to find words. Suddenly, Fei Yuan burst into the room and told Su Ying that he had news from Wanner. He delivered the astonishing revelation that Cheng Dalei was saved. On the following night, Cheng Dalei pondered the atmosphere in the heavenly prison, feeling that something was wrong. As he gazed out from his jail cell, he pondered the reality of his impending execution, and he noticed that the guards were missing and even the monk was gone as well. A sly smirk crept across Cheng Dalei's face as he realized the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. In that moment, he called upon the system, praising it as a wise guide, guardian, and representative. He also mentioned that the system was the source of all truths in the world, and she was the derivation of all things. He asked the system to listen to his call, and the system appeared, floating. With conviction, he asked the system to grant him great power and to merge with him. A sudden beep signaled the fulfillment of their contract. The system proclaimed that their minds and souls were connected, as eternal as time and space. Another beep notified that the system's sprite possession started, and it did not consume fear points for using it for the first time, and the next time he used sprite possession would consume one million fear points. The system kissed the forehead of Cheng Dalei, a subsequent notification that the possession completed, and Cheng Dalei's level increased, martial arts enhanced, and strength increased, with a duration of three incense sticks. The system communicated to Cheng Dalei that this newfound strength was the use of their contract, and a surge of energy coursed through him. Cheng Dalei decided to put this enhanced strength to the test. He shattered the wooden shackles that bound his neck and hands, releasing him from their confines. He flexed his shoulder, marveling at the power of the supreme rank. With a visible smirk on his face, he admitted that it was tough and he wasn't proficient in using it. But he mentioned that as long as the monk wasn't there, escaping from the heavenly prison was more than enough. However, the monk walked to his cell and greeted Cheng Dalei with the phrase Amitabha Buddha, to which Cheng Dalei simply looked at him, speechless. The monk praised Cheng Dalei for his skills, which prompted Cheng Dalei to become annoyed. In a minute, the monk unlocked Cheng Dalei's cell, to which he just stared at the monk. As the monk was walking away, he told Cheng Dalei to go with him. Cheng Dalei had a questioning look, but the monk looked back at him and asked if he wasn't going to leave. The monk told Cheng Dalei he had only one hour. While they were walking, the monk again told him that he had one hour and that Chang'an was not on guard against him. As Cheng Dalei laughed and joked with the monk, mentioning that he had to be on duty during the night, he also greeted the Imperial Guard and praised them for their good works. The Imperial Guard looked at them, and one recognized Cheng Dalei and was about to react. But another Imperial Guard interrupted, saying not to worry as the higher-ups sent a message to ignore Cheng Dalei. When they exited through the heavenly prison gate, Cheng Dalei offered to the monk that if he ever visited the full garden fragrant to drink flower wine in the past, he could simply mention his name, assuring him that it worked. The monk responded in silence. As they reached the forest, the monk told Cheng Dalei that he could only see him off up to that point. But Cheng Dalei requested that he wanted to bring along some other members with him. In response, the monk told him that his group received the news and was waiting for him at the tea stall miles away from Chang'an. He handed over his official uniform, seal, and sword, and informed him about his new details as new Sankin, described as yellow-faced and bearded, seven feet tall, and a seventh-ranked security officer guarding the Kinchuan Pass. Cheng Dalei questioned whether by letting him go, he essentially offered him an official position, to which the monk confirmed. Cheng Dalei looked at the monk blankly without saying a word. Suddenly, Cheng Dalei flicked the monk's head. Pissed, the monk asked what Cheng Dalei was doing. However, Cheng Dalei, visibly happy, inquired if it hurt the monk because he thought he was dreaming and wanted to get out that much. The monk is annoyed as he tightly grips his kakara, causing his hand to noticeably shake. Just as he was about to say something, he continued muttering to himself. Angry, the monk prayed in his thoughts, affirming that the Buddha didn't tell lies or use profanity. He implored the Buddha to act swiftly as he wanted to remove Cheng Dalei from his path. He said, Amitabha Buddha and remarked that it appears that he also had a violent nature when he was young. Annoyed, the monk told him to listen and informed him that no one let him go at night. Instead, a bandit broke out of the heavenly prison of the Minister of Punishment. After an hour, someone found his escape, and he became a wanted man. The monk also told Cheng Dalei that it was up to him whether to use new Sankin seal or not. But the monk suggested he should go there, prompting Cheng Dalei to ask why. The monk replied that it was because the Northwest held the king's spirit. Cheng Dalei mentioned the Northwest and wondered about Kinchuan being in the Northwest. 
He wasn't sure how strict the security check was that time. Meanwhile, the system mentioned that the trial opportunity was in vain, as she thought she was going to get killed outside. The machine also responded by asking if the system counted as escaping from prison. The system responded, seeming a bit hesitant, saying that at least Cheng Dale was out, so they could consider the task completed. But the machine mentioned that she seemed partial to him, to which the system responded with a giggle. Another beep from the system notified that the prison escape task was complete as he received Godspeed Armor Horse Zai. Cheng Dale recognized two people, calling them Old Four, and asked why they were there, inquiring about the whereabouts of the other person. Surprisingly, the person addressed Cheng Dale and was able to arouse the attention of others. They looked happy when they saw Cheng Dale and explained to him that their group had set up many spots like that along the official roads. He guessed his luck was the best, as they found him first. The Old Four ordered others to send the signal that Cheng Dale was back, and a firework lit up the night sky. After they sent the signal, his comrades gathered at the place. When they finally saw Cheng Dale, they called out to him repeatedly, addressing him. Happy, Fei Yuan asked Cheng Dale if he was fine and whether the officials had done anything to him. Cheng Dale chuckled, emphasizing that he was fine, and questioned what the officials could possibly do to him. Liu Bei expressed his joy, mentioning how glad they were to see Cheng Dale again. Meanwhile, Kin Man inquired about the direction they would be heading next. Cheng Dale informed his companions from Toad Village that they were heading to Hulu Mountain to meet the others. Fei Yuan expressed his desire that he also wanted to go with him. In response, Cheng Dale told them that they were born in Chang'an, grew up in Chang'an, and some even raised families there, emphasizing that their destinies were different. He suggested that they could come find him after he resolved certain matters. Cheng Dale called Aku and told him that since he was in Chang'an for a year, he informed him that he knew the location of their money and instructed Aku to distribute it among the others. He requested one last favor from Aku. He asked him to spread news about the events in Chang'an to the outside world, no matter how small the details. Cheng Dale also wanted everyone to know that Chang'an was still under the care of the Wule group and asked everyone to establish tea stalls along the official roads to Chang'an and requested their help in keeping an eye out for the lost members. Aku and the other members swiftly confirmed his orders. Additionally, Cheng Dale instructed them that after spreading the news, they should make their way to Hulu Mountain. As he was about to say the secret signal, Kin Man interjected and informed Cheng Dale that Xiao Yu and Lin Kong had left with a Taoist priest. Xiao Yu requested them to convey to Cheng Dale that he was exhausted and needed some time to settle down and contemplate certain matters first. Cheng Dale contemplated Xiao Yu's decision that it would indeed be good for Xiao Yu to settle down in a nice place and rest properly. Liu Bei called Cheng Dale over and inquired about his plans for the future. Cheng Dale explained that he intended to journey to the northeast and start a new toad village. But before they headed there, he proposed that they made an effort to locate their former members from the Toad Village. Fei Yuan asked for information on how they could contact him when they went to the Northeast in the future. Cheng Dale replied that if they ever passed by in the future and bore the name of Toad, they were most likely his men. Suddenly, a loud voice called him from behind, and he was taken by surprise. Liu Jai smiled radiantly, and the other ladies behind her. She smiled as she ran toward Cheng Dale. While running, she nearly stumbled but was quickly caught by Su Ying, which startled her. She glanced back at Su Ying with an air of awkwardness, while Su Ying maintained a graceful smile. Su Ying's face shifted from a graceful smile to a terrifying expression as she confronted Liu Jai, indicating that she believed Liu Jai was attempting to conceal something from her. Her words became disjointed as she struggled to convey her sentence. She referred to Liu Jai as a husband-thieving cat causing Liu Jai's face to sweat and feel embarrassed. Su Ying called Cheng Dale, who appeared apprehensive at being called. Meanwhile, Liu Jai, who was standing behind her, also gazed at Cheng Dale. With a sly smile on her face, Su Ying asked Cheng Dale to accompany her for a private conversation, leaving him visibly anxious as he struggled to accept. Under the bright moonlight, Su Ying forcefully slammed her hand against a tree, cornering Cheng Dale. Su Ying effectively cornered Cheng Dale, who was visibly unsettled. Cheng Dale could only gaze at her with fear in his eyes as he called her name. Her face reddened as she leaned in close to Cheng Dale and whispered to him to remain silent. Cheng Dale was taken aback and simply stared with his mouth agape, not uttering a word. Su Ying clenched her teeth and slowly moved closer to Cheng Dale's shoulders. She vigorously bit Cheng Dale and pinched him, causing him to cry out in pain. With a swooning expression, Cheng Dale requested that Su Ying lighten up her grip. All of a sudden, Su Ying embraced Cheng Dale and began to share with him what she knew about Liu Jai, 
even before Liu Zhai had entered his room, as if they had already become close. She explained to Cheng Dale that it was all a form of punishment. With a pout and a hint of shyness, Su Ying told Cheng Dale that he had quite the audacity. She had come all the way to Chang'an for him, and he had given her the cold shoulder. She reminded Cheng Dale of the past when he kidnapped her, and she expressed her disapproval of Liu Zhai's actions, despite already accepting her. She urged him not to forsake the old for the new. Regretfully, Cheng Dale began to apologize, but before he could explain, Su Ying interrupted him, asserting that he wasn't allowed to apologize, or else she would bite him once more. In response, he embraced Su Ying tightly with a warm hug. As they hugged, Cheng Dale called her name, and Su Ying was captivated. While they embraced each other, Cheng Dale told Su Ying that he caused her to worry and expressed his gratitude and apologized once more. He got interrupted when Su Ying playfully warned him and bit him, saying that she would leave a mark if he ever dared to fool around with other girls. Cheng Dale asked Su Ying to join him in the northwest of Kinchuan as they built another mountain village. Su Ying responded that there was no need to rush, as she wanted to return to Jiangnan first. Curious, Cheng Dale asked her why, to which she replied that the Su Chamber of Commerce in Jiangnan still needed her to settle some matters, and she believed that since Cheng Dale had started with nothing, he would certainly benefit from having some capital. Cheng Dale acknowledged her concern and informed her that he wouldn't lack capital if the resources from King New Mountain were still there. Su Ying chuckled and emphasized that the more capital he had, the better it would be for sure. She informed Cheng Dale that she had decided to let Jai Tao join their village. Cheng Dale confirmed and expressed to Su Ying that if he leaves Jai Tao behind in Chang'an, he'll be doing her a disservice, she has done him a great favor, and he will not forget that kindness. Su Ying also informed Cheng Dale that Jai Tao's body had not yet fully recovered, and she wouldn't be able to follow them on his trips, and explained that she would take Jai Tao back to Jiangnan first, and after settling the Chamber of Commerce affairs, they would go to Qin Chuan together to find him. Cheng Dale told her that they would head back first, understanding that his comrades must be getting impatient. As they bid farewell, Cheng Dale told his comrades in Chang'an that it was time for them to depart, as the world was vast, and he hoped to cross paths with them again. His comrades in Chang'an wished him good luck on their trip. Cheng Dale called out the names of Liu Bei, Guan Yu, Sai Long, and Zhang Fei. He asked them to accompany the Su Chamber of Commerce back to Jiangnan and meet him on Mount Hulu in the capital after settling affairs in Jiangnan as he waits for them. Smiling, Liu Bei reassured Cheng Dale that the four of them would not disappoint him. Cheng Dale instructed Kin Man and Shenji that they come with him to Mount Hulu, which both of them confirmed. He commanded everyone to set out. As they traveled, Cheng Dale informed them that the mountain cleft ahead led to Mount Hulu, and he mentioned that Gao Fei, and Gao who were there. Shenji was surprised, thinking that both Gao brothers were in Jiangnan. Cheng Dale clarified that they had moved just a few months ago. When they stopped in the forest to rest, Cheng Dale told Kin Man that he would guard the first half of the night, while he would take the second half of the night. While the pot of rice was cooking, Shenji asked Cheng Dale about how many men he could bring with such a method. Cheng Dale replied that it was unclear, but with just a few of them, it would be difficult to get a foothold in Kin Chuan. He emphasized that recruitment was necessary, and gathering scattered people in the world was their best option. Shenji approved that Cheng Dale was right. After the Battle of King knew they were incognito and Longting was held up as an imperial god of war, he believed that it was official news. But he also thought that in their business world, that news was not acknowledged. As the residents of Toad Village were scattered in all directions, they were unlikely to come to their senses and do good, so most of them were likely to remain mountain bandits. Cheng Dale added that no matter which village they joined when asked about their origin, they always mentioned Toad Village and King New Mountain. As a result, rumors spread in all directions. In the world of bandits, everyone knew about Toad Village, a small mountain settlement that had withstood elite soldiers and defeated 100,000 enemies. He believed that once word got out about what they were doing in the capital with a little guidance, their people scattered everywhere would come together like sparkling. After a while, Kin Man decided to take a break and rested in a tree. Meanwhile, Shenji and Linger were sleeping peacefully near the bonfire, while Cheng Dale slept soundly beside his sword. Suddenly, Kin Man silently got up and informed them that he needed to pee quickly. In the depths of the forest, an individual with a scar on his eye was observing them, hiding in the bushes. He suddenly took out his crossbow and aimed it at Cheng Dale, who was sleeping. The man pulled the trigger, sending the arrow swiftly toward Cheng Dale. The arrow was approaching Cheng Dale, while the man with the scar grinned with an evil smile, believing he had succeeded. Unexpectedly, Cheng Dale caught the arrow that was headed toward him. The man's face displayed a great look of shock. 
Cheng Dalei side-eyed him and slowly stood up. At that moment, Kin Man launched a surprise attack on the man from behind, catching him off guard. He delivered a punch, swiftly restrained the man, instructing him not to move and to behave. Cheng Dalei told the man that he had pursued them for three days and was finally ready to make his move. He questioned the man about who had sent him. In anger, the man uttered Cheng Dalei's name, and it was revealed in his information that his name was Wang Zhu. With a big grin on his face, Wang Zhu told Cheng Dalei that he wouldn't make it out of the capital alive. To their surprise, Kin Man informed that the man had bitten through the poison sack. However, within a few breaths, the man's life was cut off. Shenji commented that determination sent shivers down his spine. Cheng Dalei instructed Kin Man to search Wang Zhu's body, and reminded him to be cautious not to touch the poison blood in the man's mouth. After a couple of minutes, Cheng Dalei asked Kin Man if he found anything. Kin Man reported that the man didn't have any information on him that could identify his true identity. However, he noted that the man seemed to be a standard weapon of the Imperial Court's crossbow group. Kin Man highlighted that the man didn't have any distinctive marks that could indicate which specific unit he belonged to. He speculated that someone sent the man on behalf of the Imperial Court, but the limited information they had so far made it difficult to analyze anything. Perplexed, Cheng Dalei wondered who wanted to kill him, as he couldn't recall offending anyone. Shenji commented to Cheng Dalei that he might have some misconceptions about himself. When Shenji asked Cheng Dalei if he believed he hadn't offended anyone, Cheng Dalei, feeling unsure, realized that he indeed offended many people but didn't know who sent them. Cheng Dalei cautioned them to be careful the rest of their way, as he believed that someone else might come after them again. He gave a detailed explanation about Hulu Mountain, located hundreds of miles from Chang'an, which got its name due to its shape resembling a half-buried gourd in the ground. And because of its peculiar topography and the access to several major roads, it was home to more than a dozen mountain strongholds. These dozens of mountain villages had mutual grudge and resentment, but they were united against the enemy. The latest rising star was a group of bandits who moved from Jiangnan a few months ago. The mention of Flying Tiger Village brought to mind the faces of Gao Fei and Gao Hu. On the following day, both brothers went fishing. Gao Hu informed Gao Fei about the news that Longting had been killed, and it was Cheng Dalei who had done it. Gao Fei acknowledged the news and commented that he also wanted to see Longting die. Gao Hu expressed regret that they were missed the chance to do something significant with Cheng Dalei, particularly when they were first encountered him. Gao Fei responded that they couldn't go to Chang'an since Cheng Dalei had instructed them to wait in Hulu Mountain, so he must have his reasons for that decision. Gao Hu informed him that a few days ago, he heard that Cheng Dalei had been captured but was later rescued. He informed Gao Fei that he sent a messenger pigeon that brought news that Cheng Dalei would be coming to them. Considering the days since the letter arrived, it was almost time. He reassured Gao Hu not to worry, mentioning that he dispatched many people to the main road to pick them up and there was certainly no problem. He advised Gao Hu to focus on fishing and emphasized that they would soon be able to claim that they kept this fishing spot for a long time. In response, Gao Hu breathed heavily as they caught a fish. At that moment, a person reported bad news that Cheng Dalei had been stopped by other bandits. Both of their faces registered shock and questioned who would dare to be so bold. Fear was visible in his eyes, and Gao Fei speculated whether the enemy retaliated against Cheng Dalei. He expressed gratitude to Cheng Dalei for his support in Chang'an, even though it offended many people along the process. Gao Fei ordered his people to bring out the weapons they prepared to assist Cheng Dalei. Meanwhile, somewhere on Hulu Mountain Road, a group of people was waiting while Cheng Dalei and the others were approaching them. One of them asked which one was Cheng Dalei, pointing to an image on a reward list. Shenji and Cheng Dalei instantly said that they didn't know him. While observing the image, the person described that he carried an ordinary sword and had a mediocre appearance, expressing confidence that he couldn't be wrong. Frustrated, Cheng Dalei wondered where this description of ordinary came from. The man went on to describe Kin Man as the one with a square, broad face, dressed in black, identifying him as the large spear general. He also identified the one with an outstanding demeanor as the superb strategist and referred to Shenji as the fair complexion scholar. Cheng Dalei expressed his unease to Kin Man and ordered them to prepare to break the formation, which Kin Man affirmed. However, the person introduced himself as Huang Fei Hu, the leader of the Flying Tiger Village in Hulu Mountain, and mentioned that they were there to welcome Cheng Dalei. Cheng Dalei asked how Fei Hu dared to pretend to be a mountain bandit, demanding to know who he was. Fei Hu expressed his confusion, wondering what Cheng Dalei meant by pretending. 
he insisted that they were indeed from the Flying Tiger Village and genuinely awaited his arrival. As the bandits crowded the mountain road, one person praised Cheng Dale as supremely honorable and righteous, claiming that Gao who asked him to pick him up. Other bandits inquired about Cheng Dale's presence. Some were there to see him, and some called his attention, saying they were there to pick him up as well. The situation became more crowded as the bandits cheered and shouted his name, with one person urging him to go to the Flying Tiger Village, where everything was prepared, and another bandit mentioned that Stone Village was also ready for his arrival. While some giggled and told Cheng Dale that Tree World Village had already killed the pig, confusion was evident on the faces of Cheng Dale. Kin Man, and Shenji as they were not sure what was going on and did not know whether those people meant well or had malicious intent. Cheng Dale looked at Shenji, seeking an explanation that it should only be the Flying Tiger Village that was supposed to receive this news. He made eye contact with Shenji, which meant that they should find an excuse as the best way to leave, or should they go to the Flying Tiger Village to be safe. He sent a telepathic message to Shenji, who was also dumbfounded by the situation. With a broad smile, Shenji responded with a thumbs up, signifying that he understood Cheng Dale's message. Following their telepathic communication, Shenji instructed everyone to be quiet. Shenji proudly introduced himself to them, proclaiming that he was the one known as the superb strategist. He also mentioned that since they were there, Cheng Dale would visit all the villages. The bandits' faces lit up, and one person commented to the other that he had no business as he was the first to hear Cheng Dale's news. While the others laughed and found it amusing, some suggested that Cheng Dale should visit their stone village. Meanwhile, Shenji glanced at Cheng Dale and told him that he understood that he might be embarrassed to speak, so he expressed it for him, while Cheng Dale looked at him speechless. Amidst the noise of the crowd, Cheng Dale finally figured out the reason. It was because of Gao, who sent a pigeon from Chang into Hulu Mountain, where he settled. Cheng Dale expressed gratitude to everyone for their efforts in receiving them. The Hulu Mountain took good care of Cheng Dale, and the Chang'an underground forces wanted to do this favor. It was sort of the last implementing ceremony from the Gao brothers and Chang'an. Minutes later, Gao Fei called out Cheng Dale's name and said that they were there to pick him up. Another person asked Gao Fei if they were also there to pick up Cheng Dale and informed them that they were late as Cheng Dale was taken by the wind and cloud village first. Disbelieving, Gao Fei couldn't fathom that Cheng Dale was taken away. He promptly ordered his fellow bandits to head to the wind and cloud village and bring Cheng Dale back. In the late afternoon, the tree leaves swayed in the wind. On a hill in a distant place, a mysterious group of people gathered, and a man with an enigmatic look observed. Wearing a grim expression, he informed his followers that their lord gave an order. He declared that they would not allow Cheng Dale to leave the capital alive. His people responded with firm affirmation. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale, the butcher who wiped out 100,000 rings and killed Longting, was warmly welcomed at Hulu Mountain. Talks were held with various villages in Hulu Mountain in a friendly and lively atmosphere. At the dinner after the meeting, Cheng Dale expressed his gratitude for the warm hospitality and praised the special snacks of Hulu Mountain. Accompanied by Huang Fei Hu, Cheng Dale visited the martial arts arena, kitchen, and blacksmith store and had valuable advice. The other villages hoped that Cheng Dale could visit their village and show passion for his advanced experience and the spirit of hard work. Amidst this, Gao Fei and Gao Hu observed Cheng Dale with silent concern. With a grim expression, Gao Hu beckoned Gao Fei, who responded by asking him what it was. Gao Hu smiled and glanced at Gao Fei. He recalled a moment from a year ago when Cheng Dale told him a strange story about why he was so skilled and admitted that he didn't understand at that time. But now he could see it in Gao Fei's expression. He continued, saying that he now understood what Cheng Dale had said. Gao Fei, visibly upset, pinched Gao Hu's mouth and cursed at him, but Cheng Dale noticed them. He happily waved to them, called out their names, and mentioned that it was a long time since they had seen each other. He invited them to come and have a drink, which made them stop quarreling. Both Gao Fei and Gao Hu's faces lit up and confirmed. As the evening approached, two or three days after they arrived at Hulu Mountain, three people were thrown out of Hulu Mountain. A child called out to his father. The bandit urged them to quickly go down the mountain and toss some coins at them, stating that it was their pay. New Sanji's wife requested that they stay there even if they had to beg because at least they could have food they could eat, which was better than Yun Shui Guan. New Sanji mentioned the South, clenching his fist as he told his wife that he was a military general of the empire and was paid by the court to guard the territory. He suggested that they should return to Yun Shui Guan. 
but his wife cried and told him that he didn't even receive a salary for three years. She regretted marrying him in the first place, mentioning that she wouldn't have come to Chang'an if she hadn't married him, while their son called for their attention, asking them to wait for him. Meanwhile, the news of the incident in Chang'an spread rapidly across the world thanks to the storyteller's promotion. At Kingju White Horse Mountain, White Wolf overheard some rumors from a man who was seated nearby. He mentioned that the wicked Cheng Dalei had used a heavenly thunderbolt to kill and wound the guards. Another person added that even Longting perished due to his thunder and ran away. They discussed this until White Wolf's attention was piqued. She heard that Cheng Dalei had fled and that Chang'an's Hulu Mountain had become a gathering place for Cheng Dalei. White Wolf cast a curious glance at them. Her companion inquired about what was bothering her. She responded that there was nothing wrong. Meanwhile, at the Niujia village blacksmith shop, a man asked Zhu Yu if she was there to bid him farewell. Zhu Yu confirmed it, and her master acknowledged her, stating that her skills had nearly mastered all of his skills. He emphasized that it was time for her to go to the outside world and show off her skills. In a separate setting, Lio Yi informed his older brother that it was time to go, and Lio Jia nodded in agreement. Thus, the demon king of the mountain village wandered around the world, just like a bamboo shoot sprang up after the rain. At the same time, the northwest of the empire, Kichuan Guan. As they read the poster, Xing Zai called Fu Delay to check out the job offer, which included food, housing, and salary. Fu Delay agreed, and they decided to first have a full meal. However, the two were tricked by the black-hearted merchants and became miners, and almost died during work. Somewhere in Kichuan, there is this saying that the wind blows at the tip of the leaves, and the waves are formed between the small waves. After the incident in Chan'an, Cheng Dalei became famous around the world, and his fame was enough to stop a child from crying at night. Thirty-five mountains called his name, who in the world does not know him, and the sound of birds chirp fills the air, as fear points surged in every direction. The system diligently collected them all. The system appeared delighted as it gathered all the fear points, which rapidly increased to 6,206,410 and beyond. Since Cheng Dalei came to Hulu Mountain, all the families and villages were competing for the best feast. Shenji's face beamed with delight as he encouraged all the bandits to eat and drink as they celebrated. But every day, Cheng Dalei was getting tired of it as he just munched his food in the corner looking at them with Kin Man beside him. He asked Kin Man to keep an eye on things and ensure he didn't get drunk. Kin Man nodded while enjoying his food. The bandits continued to celebrate and banter with Shenji, playfully teased him for getting drunk after only two bottles of wine. Another chanted for refills, and some said that they ran out of wine, informing Cheng Dalei that there was no more wine. Shenji became drunk and informed Cheng Dalei that they ran out of wine, so they were heading to another village to continue their drinking. Cheng Dalei felt bored, gave a disinterested confirmation. Gao Fei's drunk face told them that they were going to the Flying Tiger Village to continue their drinking. They all shouted in excitement. Perplexed, Cheng Dalei thought about his previous statement and asked if he couldn't go with them. As they headed to another village, a person confronted his comrade, questioned if he was looking down on him. He asked whether he had merely pushed his food aside and didn't want to eat it, or if he didn't consider him a brother, while others hummed and enjoyed themselves. As they continued to travel, a person asked Cheng Dalei when he had some free time, so he could visit their village to give them some advice. Cheng Dalei sarcastically laughed and replied that he would go next time. Some individuals complimented Cheng Dalei for being able to stop 100,000 ring tribesmen, suggested that with Cheng Dalei's guidance, their village could be as solid as a diamond. As they passed down the hill, a small rock fell, while Cheng Dalei responded with an awkward laugh. He suddenly became alert when he noticed a rock fall and warned everyone to watch out, and ordered everyone to disperse. Cheng Dalei quickly jumped out from his horse and activated the possession. The system entered his body, and there was a sudden beep as the fear points decreased to 100 W. With remarkable speed, he used a phase second style exploding fireworks to slice the falling rocks, causing them to break apart. The bandits and their horses were scared, and told the others to watch out, while some confirmed that he really was Cheng Dalei. At the same time, Cheng Dalei's inner thoughts recognized the group of people on the hill as the same group last time. The group aimed their crossbows at Cheng Dalei, but Cheng Dalei swiftly slashed all the arrows headed his way using his two hearts beat as one technique, creating a clattering sound as the arrows fell to the ground. The assassins emerged from the bushes, grouping together to attack Cheng Dalei. Without wasting any time, Cheng Dalei launched a fierce counterattack with his sword. The assassins cried out in pain as they were sent flying. But after ten breaths, shouting and killing stopped. 
the expressions on the faces of everyone turned grim, leaving them momentarily speechless. They observed as Cheng Dale leaped while holding onto one of the assassins. As he landed, the ears on his head vanished. He informed Kin Man that he knocked out the assassin, and also broke his jaw and mentioned that Kin Man was familiar with this kind of work and requested his assistance in removing the poison sack from the assassin's mouth, to which Kin Man agreed. Cheng Dale placed the unconscious body of the assassin on the ground, and instructed Kin Man to be cautious not to pinch the poison sack. With eager expressions, Gao Hu requested Cheng Dale to leave the assassin to them, suggesting that his mother would not be able to recognize him after they were done with him. Meanwhile, Kin Man successfully removed the poison sack from the assassin's mouth. After that, Cheng Dale sarcastically welcomed the assassin as he woke up from a faint. Displaying a dark aura, he threatened the assassin with his sword, demanding to know who sent him and who his master was. He offered to make the assassin's good time. The assassin smirked, despite his missing tooth. He told Cheng Dale that he was about to die, and his words were cut off when Cheng Dale swung his sword into his body. The assassin groaned, while Cheng Dale calmly informed him that he could cut him a hundred times with his sword without taking his life. He continued stating that the assassin was a kamikaze soldier, and that they were related to some big shot. But he warned him not to test his patience. With his sword pointed at the assassin's face, Cheng Dale told the assassin that he might be able to endure it. He also understood that the people behind him probably promised to take care of his family. Cheng Dale revealed the assassin's name, Jiang Kai, 35 years old, and was from Jan's village in Jingzhou, as he reviewed his information, and went on to explain that he had been a disciple of the Blood Sword sect but had turned into a suicide soldier. Shocked, the assassin questioned how Cheng Dale knew all this. Cheng Dale responded calmly that he knew but didn't care, as he naturally had a way to find out who was behind him and that he just needed to put a little more effort into it. He assured the assassin that he wouldn't harm him or cause trouble for his family if he told the truth, saving him the trouble of looking for the person behind him. Terrified, the assassin admitted that he would talk. He revealed that the minister had sent them and ordered that Cheng Dale should not leave the capital alive under any circumstances. Cheng Dale asked if it was Minister Qi and mentioned that the imperial court was willing to let him go, expressing his confusion about why Qi wanted him dead. The assassin explained that Wanner had given herself in exchange for his life, but he also mentioned that Cheng Dale had killed Longting. He questioned why Minister Qi would let him go freely after that. Cheng Dale questioned what Wanner had to do with this matter, which prompted a surprise curse from the assassin who asked if Cheng Dale still didn't know. The assassin revealed to Cheng Dale that Wanner had not agreed to make peace by marrying into the Ring tribe and that he wouldn't be able to leave the heavenly prison alive now. Cheng Dale stood in silence, as he acknowledged the situation. Gao Fei mentioned that he had heard about peace talks between the Empire and the Ring tribe, stating that the Empire was required to pay tributes to the Ring tribe every year. Shenji chimed in, expressing his disdain for Emperor Ming and insulting him as a puppet of the Ring tribe. They all agreed that they would never bow down to the Ring tribe. The crowd of bandits joined in the conversation criticized the empire and labeled it as a disgrace. Some mentioned that the imperial court was hiding the news from the public, which only became public two days ago. They also mentioned that the princess left a month ago. They chanted that they should retrieve Wanner and prevent her from marrying into the Ring tribe. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale inquired about Wanner's destination. However, Gao Fei interjected and answered Cheng Dale's question that Wanner was heading to Zai Zhao Guan and it had been a month since her departure and estimated that they would exit the Sunset Pass in a few days. Cheng Dale asked the bandits for directions to Zai Zhao Guan, and one answered that it was in the north. Gao Fei questioned Cheng Dale if he robbed the bribe. He told Cheng Dale that it was too late, as Zai Zhao Guan was 2,000 miles away. But Cheng Dale determination ordered Kin Man to prepare the horses. Worried, Kin Man asked Cheng Dale if he should go with him, prompting Cheng Dale to say no, and told him to wait for him. In an instant, Cheng Dale swiftly rode his horse, assured the bandits that he would be right back. He urged his horse onward, and it dashed away at a fast pace. The bandits watched as Cheng Dale disappeared into the distance, wondering what he was planning to do. Tin Man replied that Cheng Dale thought that they were going to hold him back. He called the situation a one-man bride kidnapping. One of them praised Cheng Dale as worthy. As Cheng Dale rode throughout the night, his galloping horse kicked up yellow dust like a snake. Along the way, he encountered assassins who confronted him, warning that it was to be his last day. 
However, Cheng Dalei paid no attention to the assassins' threats and continued moving forward. The assassins leaped from the trees as they were going to attack to kill. Cheng Dalei dismounted his horse with a swift move technique of the colorless double-winged phoenix. He dashed toward the assassins and launched an attack using his exploding fireworks technique, swiftly defeated them all. The assassins wore expressions of defeat as their lifeless bodies were thrown aside. Cheng Dalei returned to his horse and continued his journey. He whipped his horse and as he rode, he released the possession, allowing the system to leave his body. Frustrated, Cheng Dalei clenched his jaw as he thought that he was still slow. To increase the horse's speed, the system used an item called Godspeed Armor Horse, which was consumable. The horse neighed as its speed drastically increased, becoming capable of maintaining this incredible speed for up to three days. Cheng Dalei's journey to the north became much faster. The system encouraged Cheng Dalei and cheered him to go all the way to the north. As the sun began to set, accompanied by a fitting saying that he headed north, away from the world with them. They lamented that they were tired and could no longer fall in love with anyone anymore. At Yellow Sand, there were ancient roads and tea stalls. He was a bounty hunter and a killer. It was said that he woke up at the clock at night every day. He opened the window and let the cool breeze into the house. Then he washed his face and mouth, and after that, he changed clothes. There was a contradiction in assassins' jobs. First, they couldn't be too famous, and second, they couldn't be without fame. If they had fame, they would be found wherever they went, and if they were not famous no one would look to kill them. He was successful and ordinary looking. In the crowd he was like a drop of water in the sea, but in the industry, he had a lot of fame. Many people knew the saying in the world of assassins, find that man, pay him up, and he would kill a person for you. No matter who the target was, he never missed. His swordsmanship was average, he just could endure and wait. His appearance made newcomers understand that killing did not require much effort. It was not about holding a sword and looking for a fight, shouting that next year this same day was going to be his death anniversary. Such behavior seemed very undignified, and this line made him seem more like a villain. He had to say, he changed the current situation of the industry with his own efforts. He made those rude and ill-tempered killers begin to learn intelligence gathering, target planning, and risk analysis. He invented many new methods. He was the leader of the industry reform. That day, there was a list, a big list of 5,000 tales, while putting woods in the fire. He was waiting. The person he was waiting for had not arrived yet. He was not in a hurry. He once spent three years trying to make a friend and he killed him. He did not mind cooking a pot of tea eggs in one hour and waiting for someone for one day, until the person he was waiting for arrived and he respectfully served him tea. When the other person felt relaxed, he pulled out the thin sword hidden in the bamboo pole and pierced the heart of the other person. Then, he would guard the other person's body to finish a cup of tea and eggs and cut off the target's head and leave, receive the reward, squander, hide his tracks, and wait for the next big list. Cheng Dalei halted, his gaze fixed on the man. The man smiled and inquired about Cheng Dalei's food preferences, mentioning that his specialty was tea and eggs, which smelled good. Cheng Dalei threw his water bag to the man, instructing him to fill it with water and provide his horse with some high-quality fodder. He dismounted from his horse and informed the man that he wanted a cup of tea and eggs, packing an additional 30 for himself to take on the journey. The man promptly served Cheng Dalei's food on the table and asked if Cheng Dalei wanted a cup of tea and eggs. Cheng Dalei confirmed that he did. The man inquired again about the reason for Cheng Dalei's rush. Without hesitation, Cheng Dalei swiftly unsheathed his swords and slashed the man's throat. The food the man was carrying flew out and the man's face contorted in shock as blood splattered. Cheng Dalei's expression remained serious. The man lay lifeless on the ground, while Cheng Dalei caught the food that was thrown. Cheng Dalei glanced at the man's body and commented that, because he was in a hurry, he didn't have time for unnecessary conversation. He offered an apology. Struggling to speak, the man inquired why Cheng Dalei was apologizing. Cheng Dalei responded by advising him not to use something to occupy his hand. The man continued to ask why Cheng Dalei knew and how he could know. But Cheng Dalei just watched him in silence. Cheng Dalei went on to clarify that he had seen through the man. In the near-death glance, the nameless killer seemed to see the shining figure around the target. It was like an immortal. Despite the surrounding yellow sand, ancient roads, and tea stalls, Cheng Dalei appeared unfazed as he sat down. He used a pin to poke the eggs, examining them closely. Observing that the eggs showed no signs of poison, he proceeded to eat them. 
as he chewed. He commented that they smelled incredibly good after taking a bite. The Sunset Fort was the furthest fort in the northeast of the Empire, and beyond this fort were the grasslands ruled by the Ring's tribes. A soldier informed his lord that the Ming Yu princess was about to leave the fort, asked how many people were they sending with her. His lord answered to just send a troop of a thousand as it was just for formalities. They would return as soon as she arrived there, and he said with disgust that using a woman to exchange for peace was a huge disgrace to their empire. The soldier told his lord that he heard rumors of people plotting to kidnap the princess, questioned that there weren't a thousand warriors, too few, and even the Merlian guards accompanying the princess only numbered 500. The Sunset Fort's leading general replied that so what if it was 500? Those were 500 Merlian guards. His soldier inquired about the Merlian guard as he kept hearing about them. He asked what was so great about the Merlian guards. The Sunset Fort's leading general replied that this particular troop operated directly under the Ming Emperor, and they were the Emperor's sharpest sword and the toughest shield. The Merlian guards could be separated into the Carp and Dragon Warriors, and there were 36 Dragon Warriors, and they were further separated into True Dragon and Latent Dragon Guardians. There were only three True Dragons. They were in charge of protecting the Emperor, which were Liu Aji from the Guardian of the Inner Court, King Yifu the Monk, and Tong Fei of the Blossom Spear. The other 33 Latent Dragons were swords the Ming Emperors secretly planted in the Jianghu. If placed into the army, they could easily become a great general, and when placed into the Jianghu, they could easily be the cream of the crop. As for the Carp Warrior, they were all orphans who had undergone special training and were highly skilled martial masters. They were separated into many different platoons, with each bearing a name of a beast, such as a snake, tiger, eagle, and so on. In short, the Merlian guards were adept warriors that the Ming Emperor spared no effort to raise. This operation had five dragon warriors and 500 carp warriors. Tong Fei apologized for the inconvenience to her highness because of the urgency of the matter. They couldn't allow her to rest for a few more days in the Sunset Fort. The Ming Yu princess replied that there was no need for that. As long as she could protect the empire from the rings, this little hardship means nothing. Tong Fei thought in her mind that she heard the Ming Yu princess was spoiled and mischievous, but she guessed the rumors were not true, and no wonder why the emperor favored her the most among all the princesses. It was such a shame that such a huge empire still had to sacrifice such a young girl just to earn a few short years of peace. Suddenly, a frantic soldier rode his horse to report. He screamed that there were corpses ahead, all dressed as merchants and seemed to have just been killed. Another soldier approached Tong Fei and informed her that they entered the territory of the horse bandits. He said that within the vicinity, there were 13 groups of horse bandits. Their leader was known as Gui Jian Chu, and he was a vicious murderer. Tong Fei questioned what was there to be scared about as it was just some horse bandits. If they dared to appear, she would do Sunset Fort a favor and get rid of them. At dusk, thousands of soldiers who had been lined up in marching reached a road surrounded by a massive rock mountain. A soldier informed Tong Fei that people were following behind them, since their lights might be seen in the pitch black night. He added that this was one of their strategies, they would follow behind others and slowly wait for them to wear down before striking. Tong Fei called out for drunkards. She said she would have to ask him to take a short trip and get rid of everyone behind them. Drunkard chugged his bottle. Jiu Meng, the drunkard of the latent dragon guardian, burped, complained about this little girl who really liked to order people around, kept asking him to act every time something came up, and asked why she couldn't let him rest for a bit. However, he rode his horse towards those who followed them and said fine, he would be right back, while others stayed behind. A concerned soldier told Tong Fei that the horse bandits were not weak and asked why not send someone to support him, to which Tong Fei confidently replied that there was no need. Tong Fei added that the drunkard could do it alone. 45 minutes later, the drunkard came back carrying someone in his hand. Drunkard reported that there were less than 20 of them. He killed some, and the rest ran away. He said that he drank too much and couldn't control his strength while raising someone like a paper bag. He added that he wanted to catch a few live ones, but he guessed he had too much strength and he died on the way back. He dropped the body on the ground and burped. Tong Fei asked if it was Gui Jian Chu's men. A soldier answered yes, the bone mask he was wearing was a symbol of Gui Jian Chu's gang. His quiver was also full, and only Jian Chu's gang had that kind of money. Inside the carriage, the Ming Yu princess asked Tong Fei if something was wrong out there. Tong Fei respectfully responded to the princess that they came across something and stopped there for a while. The Ming Yu princess asked again if it would take long, to which Tong Fei answered that it wouldn't take long, and the princess replied to wait a little longer. After the long trip, she was just about to take a break, 
To which Tong Fei agreed. Tong Fei raised her hand and loudly instructed all to heed her command and quickly go to the abandoned building in front of them. She added that they should set up camp there and build defenses, as they would have some fun with these horse bandits, to which her troops affirmed. The mountain of the boulder was covered in stars during the night. A group of horse bandits gathered near where their fellow bandits were slaughtered. A man casually sitting on a boulder questioned if just one person did this. Someone answered yes, just one person. He was very powerful, and all of them could not stop him. It was Gooey Giant Chu, who sat and smoked with a sword in his hand and said that the carp dragon guards were truly worthy of their fame. He chuckled and asked when the rest of the villagers would arrive. Then, a bandit reporting to his village master stated that the others would be able to come together overnight, and tomorrow morning they could start. Gooey Giant Chu uttered that it was actually not bad to have a princess for a wife. The yellow sand was rising, and they were already at the imperial border. Someone sat and poured water on his winnie house, and they had covered 2,000 miles in just three days. It was Cheng Dale, who said, good job. He told his horse to get some rest, and he would go the rest of the way himself. More and more people gathered around Cheng Dale. They stood near Cheng Dale while he petted his horse. He asked how far it was to Zizhe Aguan. The top judicial officer replied that it was 200 miles to go. The top thief also replied that it took a day and night to walk there. A top actor added that the road was not good, and they would not be there until dusk tomorrow at the earliest. A top porter chimed in as well, saying that if his horse was fast enough, he could do it in a day. A system pop-out description for the restraints regarding the four of the lower nine consisted of the yamen, flutist, shaman, prostitute, witch, night watchman, hairstylist, drummer, and actor, the lower strata of society, especially for the entertainment and recreation of dignitaries. Cheng Dale stood up, thanked everyone, and time was running out. He had one last question. He fiercely told them that they were going to die soon, and Cheng Dale asked if they would like to leave some last words. Suddenly, the top actor, porter, thief, and judicial officer simultaneously advanced towards Cheng Dale, and drew their weapons, aiming at him while he remained calm. Several slashes were made and given in this brawl. After slashing their throats, Cheng Dale sighed and said, never mind. He added that no one would remember it anyway, while flyers with Cheng Dale's face on them flew everywhere above their dead bodies. A massive army horde was in the distance in the early morning fog. A soldier complained that it was foggy and commanded everyone to tighten up security, and be on alert. Tong Fei replied that their trip would take at least 15 more days and that sooner or later they would be in trouble if they allowed them to follow them in this way. She proposed finishing them off right there. The soldier replied that he sent men to Zizhe Aguan to get reinforcements and tell them that they lured Gui Giant Chu there. When the main army arrived, they could kill them all. Tong Fei was surrounded by fog and said that it smelled weird. She screamed and cursed when she realized that the fog was poisonous. She alerted everyone to cover their mouths and noses with cloth and not to inhale the smoke from the fog. Someone asked over the fire if the news was spread, and someone answered this news was spread throughout the bandit world. Everyone wanted to get the soon-to-be-married Princess Mingyu. It was from the horse bandit who purposely created the heavy fog. He chuckled and said it was known everywhere in the high mountains. That was, in addition to their 13 villages, at least tens of thousands of people came there. It was Gui Giant Chu who said that this was a big event in the world of bandits. Whoever could win over the princess could laugh at the others and be proud of themselves. While smoking, he told his brothers that they were the first to arrive. The horse bandits went on to advance and screamed to kill them. Tong Fei fiercely alerted the arrow squad to stand by. The arrow squad released the arrows on her command. In the fog, bows and arrows were generally more effective. Tong Fei called Ju Tu to take his men and guard the princess there. She fiercely headed on to the battle with the fish dragon guards. They were slashing horse bandits with their swords. Several horse bandits were killed. Like two tides colliding, Tong Fei drove away 5,000 horse bandits with 300 fish dragon guards. They kept attacking, and blood shed on both tides. Tong Fei commanded to drive them back. They just had to hold out until the reinforcements from Zizhe Aguan arrived, and Jiu Tu agreed. Someone told the princess to go inside the castle building, as it was too dangerous outside. The lady was concerned as she called the princess. The princess said if it was before, she would have been scared and screamed but not anymore. She questioned her father if this was what he had been dealing with. The princess saw the dead soldiers covered in blood and lying on the ground. Just do the right thing, no matter what the situation was. The princess remained calm amidst it all. Sacrifice what should be sacrificed, give up what should be given up, and do not let their emotions distract them. She closed her eyes, but at the bottom of her closed heart, the princess still harbored a trace of inexplicable hope. 
Fast forward. The battle lasted from morning until sunset. Both sides engaged in one cavalry duel after another. The horse bandits outnumbered the fish dragon guards and fought round after round to consume their physical strength. Tong Fei commanded to defend the castle repeatedly and not let the bandits hurt the princess. She thought in her head why the backup was not there yet and the opponents became more in numbers with every push. Another horde of bandits went to attack, pushed forward and grabbed the princess. Tong Fei was shocked as she saw what was coming. Her pupil became large, when she realized that they were not horse bandits and they were from other factions. Kai Fagui, the first of the 18 water bandits in the Lyo Mountain, was laughing as he called his brother to attack grabbed the princess, and played with her together. Gui Giant Chu was not impressed seeing the old red-headed bandit was there too. He ordered his men to seal the back gate because they wanted to run away from the back gate. Tong Fei alerted his troops that there were too many enemies, and the defense line had been broken. Lu Ju was ordered to take men with him to escort Princess Ming Yu out there, and he agreed while others would cover for them. The bandits were laughing as they surrounded them, blocked their retreat, and alerted others that they ran south. A wooden royal carriage was wheeled out frantically as they were escorting away the princess. They cleared a path for them as they hurried to get away, and they protected the princess and didn't let any bandits get close to them. However, the enemy blocked the front and they called for Luo Ju and were told to run them over. Lu Ju commanded them to attack and push with him as they planned to break through their encirclement. The curtain of the carriage was splashed with blood while they rushed through in one breath and kept attacking in hopes of breaking their formation. Princess Ming Yu couldn't help but peek outside her window as she heard screaming guards that were bleeding out. At the confrontation with killing and death, inside the royal carriage, the princess was trembling. A lot of killing and struggling were heard while the princess remained inside the royal carriage. She was silent and curled up while tears built up in her eyes. The carriage was already surrounded, unable to move, and the bandits were laughing and screaming to kill them all. These bandits were aggressive in surrounding and stopping them in order to grab the princess, while the guards struggled to break the siege. Suddenly, the bandits were caught by surprise as there were enemies behind and slashed through them as a result. Some flew right away. Lu Ju wondered if it could be that support from Sai Zhao Guan had arrived. A loud thud of an animal was heard. It was Cheng Dale, summoning the heart to possess him, and she flew right through him, while it cost him 100 W fear points. Heart, the system spirit, told Cheng Dale that it was okay to go all out. The masked bandits were pissed and questioned who that guy was, went to kill him. Suddenly, Cheng Dale flew right in front of them, which caught the masked bandits by surprise. At that moment, the crow saw a flying toad in the sky and was amazed by a soldier that he had an awesome flying skill. Lu Ju inquired where he was from and why he hadn't seen him before, but before he could finish his sentence, Cheng Dale interrupted him by forcefully stomping on his face. His foot fit perfectly and landed on Lu Aji's face. As Cheng Dale lifted his feet, Lu Aji spewed blood from his mouth, which concerned and terrified his soldiers. Cheng Dale jumped and landed in the wooden royal carriage while holding his sword. He used Alfie swordsmanship. Cheng Dale swiftly stroked his sword side to side, slashing at the wooden royal carriage. As the carriage broke apart, Cheng Dale called the princess, Lai Wanner. He asked her why she didn't notify him she was going to get married. The princess sat, looked up, and uttered Cheng Dale's name. He grabbed her hands and questioned what she was waiting for. Cheng Dale frantically said that there was no time to get on, while the princess was still surprised. This was the moment when the princess Minju became Lai Wanner again. Both the soldiers and bandits were wondering who he was and how dared this bastard intercept them. Someone called his troops to kill Cheng Dale, while he stroked his sword and rode the black horse with Lai Wanner. His sword cut a rope connecting the horse to the carriage. Tong Fei was breaking the back of the crowd and couldn't be stopped as she frantically yelled not to let him take the princess because he was the mountain bandit, Cheng Dale. The soldiers cursed and screamed in panic, not letting him take the princess. They went after Cheng Dale, however. He managed to execute the exploding fireworks through his sword and told them to go away. The crowd of masked bandits went after Cheng Dale, where they shouted to kill him because he was the princess, and they wanted to grab her. Cheng Dale told her that he would break the net that surrounded them in one breath, and warned Lai Dong to hold on tight, as he raised his speedy sword for an attack. Cheng Dale slashed through them like explosive fireworks. They could only scream their pain away as they met the powerful sword attack by Cheng Dale, and he ran away with it. Others tried to pursue him because he was getting away with the princess, while Cheng Dale calmly told her that they had finally broken through and to run for their lives. Their horse hair brushed against the breeze as they rode away with as much speed as they could. Suddenly, someone appeared on their way along with the troops behind them, but he already drew his sword. 
with a sinister smile on his face, it was Gui Jianchu on horseback. This made Cheng Dalei visibly pissed. While Gui Jianchu uttered to thank him for giving the princess, a description of him emerged that at age 23, an orphan but he was famous supreme rank horse bandit, the first of the 13 horse bandits, known as the fastest swordsman in the grassland, and he could cut the falling rocks from the cliffs. Cheng Dalei swiftly drew his sword ready. They both raised their swords and positioned themselves for a battle as they were near to one another. However, it was Cheng Dalei fast enough to slash through his sword at Gui Jianchu that resulted in blood splatter. Blood gushed out of Gui Jianchu left him stunned and speechless. He had wide open eyes, and blood was streaming down his face. He slowly fell down from his horse. Suddenly, a notification emerged congratulating Cheng Dalei's completion of rivers and lakes of the world as he defeated the horse bandit Gui Jianchu in a quick head-to-head -head sword duel and was awarded with one lottery draw. Lai Wanner questioned if Cheng Dalei killed him and said that the man just now did not look like a horse bandit. Cheng Dalei replied that he just saw him raise his sword at him or maybe his eyes were getting blurry. Cheng Dalei and Lai Wanner went on their way, while the horse bandits were surprised that their village master was struck down. For a long time, Gui Jianchu, the head of the 13 horse bandits in the border city where he relied on a swift sword and a ruthless character in the grasslands, laughed that he could not see anything clearly at all, while his troops were concerned about him and asked if he was alright. For the first time, he felt a really fast sword and praised him for it. Blood continued to drip as he laughed. He said that he would get to him, he wanted his sword, forced him to reveal his sword technique and he would get the princess. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei was still pursued by soldiers, and someone was screaming at him that he could not escape them. Tong Fei fiercely rode her horse, wanting to get the princess back. Cheng Dalei was upset at them for being a pain in the ass. He couldn't shake them. There were no obstacles in the prairie, and he could only try to move away from them. The system spirit's possession lifted as she appeared to warn Cheng Dalei that the time limit for possession had expired. It would take 12 hours before he could be possessed again. If she caught up with him, he would find himself in serious trouble, and this made Cheng Dalei curse. The system spirit told Cheng Dalei that he still had one chance to win the lottery, and asked if he wanted to try his luck, to which he replied to do it and see if they could draw something useful. The system spirit called the raffle machine, so it was up to him who appeared next to her and said good. He went on to say that the raffle had begun. Balls and golden hues emerged immediately. Then, a golden ball opened, and he obtained background music. A description appeared that the host had acquired background music, starting the battle song function. Different background music could give the host different attributes when activated, consuming anywhere from a hundred thousand to millions of fear points depending on its duration. The stronger effect of the battle song, the more it consumed, which made the system spirit surprised because the new feature she had developed earlier was finally online. Cheng Dalei thought in his head and wondered about battle background music. He asked if he had to sing and fight people at the same time. Cheng Dalei was speechless as he imagined himself singing about the great river flows north, and the stars in the sky referred to the Big Dipper. However, he was still being aggressively chased by Kai Fagui demanding that he did not run away. Tong Fei called to give her back the princess, and Gui Jianchu wanted his sword book and the princess, while Cheng Dalei panicked as there were more and more pursuers and he was being caught up. Cheng Dalei thought to try it first and cleared his throat. Suddenly, he started singing about the great river flowing north, and the stars in the sky referred to the Big Dipper. Lai Wanner called his name and looked back wondering, while Cheng Dalei continued singing. Cheng Dalei wondered that there was no reaction and thought that he would try a little louder which made those behind him confused, including Kai Fagui, Tong Fei, and Gui Jianchu. They thought in their heads that he was gone because he was being persecuted and questioned why he was still in the mood to sing a song. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei was panicking that it had no response decided to try another song. Afterwards he started singing with lyrics of the pride faces 10,000 waves and the passionate blood like the red sunlight. On the other hand, this made Lai Wanner pissed off as he called him out that he was still in the mood to sing in a situation like that. Desperate, Cheng Dalei called the system spirit and questioned why she had to be like that and begged to tell him how to use it while the system spirit giggled. She called him dummy, snapped her finger and said go music, got herself and around her ready. She was accompanied as well by the giddy raffle machine. The system spirit began strumming on her bass guitar passionately inside this circle with circuit print on it. She confidently sang the lyrics about seeing someone's body in the moonlight. The system spirit continued singing passionately. Meanwhile, these gave Cheng Dalei a boost. 
she went on rocking the song of which was titled Deja Vu from the Italian composer Dave Rogers and also Cheng Dale went on significantly faster on his horse. These shocked Kai Fagui and Tong Fei while Gui Jianchu realized he wanted Cheng Dale's horse too. Cheng Dale's background music gave him an additional 50% on his race speed and Lai Wanner was struggling to cope up with the speed. Then, when he was actually quite far away, he bid them goodbye. After the disappearance of the common goal, only the three groups of people who are resentful towards each other remained. It was another battle of confusion. At night, Luo Ju asked Tong Fei if she got the princess back, to which she answered, no. She added that the bastard suddenly went berserk, killed his way out, and soon disappeared. A soldier questioned why he would take the princess away if she had done him a favor. Also, Luo Ju questioned how a mountain bandit had humanity because they were a bunch of ungrateful beasts. Tong Fei replied that Cheng Dale had kidnapped the princess and was definitely on his way to the border. She commanded Luo Ju to take a few men back to Zizhao Pass, gave the order to close the roads at all gates, and not allow any entry, to which he agreed. She also added that with the power he displayed that day, ordinary carp guards could no longer stop him. To get the princess back, they needed the dragon guards. Tong Fei asked them to return to the capital to ask His Majesty Emperor Ming to issue the fish dragon order and move 33 submerged dragon guards out of the border area. Moments later at the horse bandit's lair, Giguan village, a bandit told Guo Jianchu, his village master, that the information had been confirmed. He went on to say that the person who took the princess was called Cheng Dale. Guo Jianchu had a bandage on his face and was still bleeding when he uttered Cheng Dale's name. He giggled as he remembered the fast sword he possessed, a sword he couldn't see clearly. A bandit asked Guo Jianchu what they should do. He replied that Cheng Dale must still be in the grassland. He ordered them to find and capture him because Guo Jianchu desperately wanted the princess, his sword technique, his sword, and his horse, he wanted it all. So, the overwhelming number of horse bandits dispersed and began searching for Cheng Dale in the grasslands. Meanwhile, there were the water bandits and Kui Xiang's gatekeeper assassins. The mountain bandits, robbers, criminals, and other heroes of this field within the border. All of a sudden, the open wilderness was crowded, including the empire's fish dragon guards, horse bandits, water bandits, assassins, swordsmen, mountain bandits, bounty hunters, and even warriors there to kill him and eliminate him for certain people. Everyone's goal was clear, get the princess or kill Cheng Dale. Somewhere in another place at night, someone said that he was so exhausted. It was Cheng Dale, laid back on the ground, saying to Lai Wanner that she didn't expect him to show up because how could he let her marry into the rings. Lai Wanner sat near him and told him that if he could take her. Cheng Dale interrupted her and replied, just give him a break, and he would take her back. Lai Wanner clarified that she didn't mean to take her back, he should take her to the royal city of the ring tribe so that he could marry Hu Yan Ba, king of the ring tribe, which made Cheng Dale's eyes widen in shock. He questioned if she were mad with fright, because he heard that this Hu Yan Ba was basically a human-like beast. He had made countless girls and children suffer to death, and she was willing to marry him. Cheng Dale asked her if she agreed to the marriage to save him or if she wanted to marry there voluntarily. Lai Wanner answered, yes, she had the responsibility to get married, and if she had to get married, why shouldn't she save him through that too? She grew up with a lot of respect and got things that a lot of people don't get in their lives. Perhaps she was waiting for this day to marry herself to the rings and become an emissary of peace between the two groups. She continued to say that every person had a purpose in life on earth. Her sacrifice alone was enough so that there would be peace between the two tribes for at least five years. So that the empire could recover, people would not have to be driven out, and the soldiers would not have to die in battle. She added that the sacrifice was worth it. At that time, Cheng Dale did not know whether he was standing in front of the imperial princess Minju or the mischievous and fickle little Lai Wanner. The two identities were one and the same, and yet they were so different. She had grown up. Growing up doesn't happen slowly, it happens instantly. At a certain moment, it suddenly became clear she folded her wings, put on her helmet, and ran towards the battlefield. Lai Wanner, with visibly sad eyes, stared at Cheng Dale. She sighed as she thought in her head that the body did not belong to itself in this society. In her case, she feared, she also understood the hopelessness of life. Cheng Dale replied that her theory of predestination, responsibility, and sacrifice sounded very much like one person. He questioned if her father made that up, to which Lai Wanner was speechless. Lai Wanner, in her royal red robe and her long, gorgeous, laid-back hair, answered that he was a mountain bandit. He couldn't understand what she meant anyway 
while Cheng Dale was speechless. Cheng Dale thought in his head that it was really, as the saying goes, if there was a stupid mother, there was a whole nest of stupid fathers. When she had such a stupid father like that, it was easy to understand even if she was not enlightened. Lai Wanner told him that if he did not want to take her to the royal city of the rings, it was okay. If he helped her find the fish dragon guards, Cheng Dale replied that these guards of hers couldn't do anything. At the moment, she didn't know how many criminals wanted her for themselves. There were also many people with strong connections who wanted her for themselves. Lai Wanner asked if he meant to say that he was more capable than her guards. Before Cheng Dale could answer, she demanded he take her there. He got enraged with her nonsense and said he was there to take her away, not to accompany her. Lai Wanner replied no, since he could take her away from others, he had to take her there. To which Cheng Dale asked what if he don't let her go. He was a mountain bandit. So he wondered if she was not afraid he would take her back to his village to make her his wife. Lai Wanner replied that she would die to show him her resolve. Their faces were blushing, they got extremely close and were both speechless. Cheng Dale said that two people who were this close usually kissed each other. Cheng Dale thought in his head that it was too close and wondered why she didn't go back. Lai Wanner sighed, she got up. She pushed herself towards Cheng Dale, which caught him off guard. She breathed near his ear, and his face got red. Cheng Dale was defeated. Suddenly, a notification was received, which triggered a two-choice task. The system spirit appeared and teased the hot-blooded young man as he once again faced a dilemma to choose. Would he bravely venture into the lion's den or claim the beauty for himself? It was now up to his decision. Cheng Dale had triggered an escort mission, which was an epic mission that would influence the direction of the world pattern. The mission content was escorting Princess Minju to the Royal City of the Rings. In return, there would be five years of peace for the Empire. This task was extremely difficult and could be rejected. Another mission was triggered for the abduction of the woman. The target was Princess Minju. The special status of the target increased the difficulty of the task. This could be rejected, and the reward was a wife. Cheng Dale backed up, telling Lai Wanner to stop and restrain herself. Lai Wanner, in her shaky voice, asked him what he was afraid of. Cheng Dale conceded that he was afraid of her. Lai Wanner replied that he was afraid to take her to the royal city of the rings. So he told her he would think about it which made Lai Wanner irritated. Cheng Dale thought in his head, how could this woman be so perverted? He almost couldn't keep his V-card. They both sat on the grass while Cheng Dale checked his screen. He thought in his head, how come this was another one of those elective missions, finish one of them, and the second one disappears automatically. First of all, the first task certainly seemed to affect the power of the world, but the conditions to achieve this were a five-year peace treaty for the Empire. There was also his wife. It seemed simple, but once little Lai Wanner was forcibly taken away, he feared that the consequences would be no less dire than the other task. Furthermore, he had a wife. Then he was sweating heavily, thinking, how could he bring another one? It seemed like the answer was just crying out to be answered. He placed his hand on Lai Wanner's head and said, all right. Cheng Dale said that since she wanted to see it, he agreed to take her to the royal city of the rings. Lai Wanner smiled when he finally agreed. He questioned why she had a happy look, as if they were going shopping. They were obviously going deep into the enemy camp where she had nine chances to die and one chance to live. He went on to say that since she had decided to go, she must think about how to go on because he was afraid the journey would not be peaceful. So she needed to listen to him, to which Lai Wanner agreed. He asked her to take off her clothes first. This shocked Lai Wanner and she asked what he wanted to do, which made him pissed and speechless. Cheng Dale explained that now he did not know how many people were looking for them. The way she was dressed was too noticeable, although his DPS was very strong. She did not have to pull weight on him. Lai Wanner replied that she did not have a change of clothes either, and Cheng Dale answered to take off the gold and silver jewelry from the dress. If they were too heavy, they would affect the movement, and these things could be used as money on the trip. In the morning, on a certain service road in the grassland, a man told the miss of the blue merchant house that it was almost dark. Then he suggested that they find a place to rest, to which she replied to push forward through the night. It was Gui Jianchu's territory, and they should not stay a moment. The faster they passed, the better, and the man agreed. Another man's eyes widened as he informed the miss that two people were coming over. He said that they looked like they were not horse bandits. The man called their attention and asked where they were headed. It was fate that they met and invited them to go together. Cheng Dale denied that it was not convenient. The miss of the blue merchant house asked if they were afraid of encountering horse bandits. There were horse bandits on this road, and if they went together, there was a good chance they could make it out together. Another man added he had been practicing his sword for five years, but he hadn't taken the usual horse bandits seriously. 
To which Cheng Dale laughed and said, pretty good. Cheng Dali and Lai Wanner left and told them to take care, while the man sighed because it seemed that they did not want to make friends. The miss of the blue merchant house looked back at them and said that they were an odd couple. The caravan continued to move after an hour had passed and noticed there were people in the front. There was a horde of troops on horseback, which made them terrified. It alerted his troop that someone was coming up ahead. The terrified men told the miss of the blue merchant house that they were the horse bandits. She commanded to move as she confirmed that it was them. Gui Jianchu of the border city, where they wore skull masks. The horse bandits Gui Jianchu led were holed up in the grasslands and robbed passing merchants. The men were killed on the spot, the women were brought back, abused, and bodies dumped in the forest. However, today the horse bandits seemed to have no time for the prey that was within their reach. They were shocked and questioned if they were gone, if they didn't see them, and if they saw them, why would they let them go? Even the miss of the blue merchant house wondered that they were not really after them. They continued to wonder who they were really after, but someone brushed it off and said to move as they needed to get out of there. The sun was setting, and someone informed the miss of the blue merchant house that it was getting dark. She replied that on this path, they risked their lives for money and would be at a loss when they encountered the horse bandits again. She insisted on continuing. She detected the scent of blood and alerted them to be cautious as something might have happened up ahead. A man drew the attention of the miss of the blue merchant house and added that he recognized them as the bandits they had recently seen. Cheng Dale and Lai Wanner stood amidst the lifeless bodies while the man questioned whether the horse bandits from earlier were all dead. Lai Wanner informed Cheng Dale that someone was approaching. They turned around, and Cheng Dale recognized them from earlier. A man, holding his sword, was trembling in fear and told Cheng Dale not to come any closer. He frantically explained that he had a sword and had been practicing sword fighting for five years, claiming to be quite skilled. He had recently encountered a horse thief and was in a state of shock but managed to request not to approach. Cheng Dale wondered if this man had gone mad with fear or if he was genuinely terrifying. He inquired about who was in charge. The miss of the blue merchant house replied that she was in charge and pleaded for her life, offering to hand over all the goods. Cheng Dale agreed, mentioning something about a robbery, IC, IP, IQ card, and providing passwords, which confused the miss of the blue merchant house. Cheng Dale also instructed her to remove her clothes. The miss of the blue merchant house's eyes widened in shock. She only comprehended the last sentence and asked him what he intended to do. Lai Wanner called out to Cheng Dale and abruptly punched him on the head, remarking that he was talking nonsense. Lai Wanner softly laughed as she inquired if there were any men's or women's clothes because they couldn't wear their current attire due to the blood stains. Cheng Dale remained silent. The miss of the blue merchant house confirmed that there were such clothes available. Lai Wanner requested a carriage and some food, politely instructing them to prepare for it. The miss of the blue merchant house ordered the man on horseback to unload their belongings, free up a carriage, and prepare food and clothes, to which the man agreed. A few moments later, Lai Wanner mentioned that there was a nice robe, a sturdy warrior suit, a woman's dress, and a hat in there. The miss of the blue merchant house replied that she could take anything she wanted and just take it. Lai Wanner fumbled and searched, said the stuff was pretty neat and loaded all of those onto the carriage. Suddenly, she held a pink bib that made her wonder. Lai Wanner thought in her head that the bib was a little too big. Cheng Dale got her attention and asked if she was done because they should go. The miss of the blue merchant house proudly said that it was hers, and Lai Wanner could take it if she wanted. However, she hesitated because the size was a little too big. She noticed something. Her hand reached for something and demanded to have that one. She took the scarf from the head of the miss of the blue merchant house. Lai Wanner was amazed and praised her for being so pretty. The miss of the blue merchant house became visibly sad and asked what she was doing because it was her scarf, as she explained that on the grassland, it was too dangerous for a good-looking female. Lai Wanner giggled, saying that this was exactly what she needed and thanked her. Cheng Dale warned Lai Wanner that if she did not come right there, he would leave her behind and threatened to leave now, to which she panicked. Lai Wanner told her that she was leaving now, this was for her, checked if it was enough for her, the road ahead was not peaceful, and a beautiful woman like her should be more careful. She ran towards the carriage, called Cheng Dale an asshole, and told him to wait for her. The miss of the blue merchant house thought in her head that a night pearl was worth a lot of money. She held the night pearl on her fingertips and wondered if it was worth it just for a carriage and some sundries. A man with a strong bandit aura and a girl from a wealthy family in a wedding dress, she wondered if they were running away from marriage. At night, they stopped the carriage to dip in a massive lake. Cheng Dale washed himself up in the lake. He put on his clothes and walked near the carriage where Lai Wanner was sitting. She asked him if he was done washing up. 
Cheng Dalei replied that he was and she could come out now. Lai Wanner looked at him seriously and silently. Then she questioned if he was not going to peek. Cheng Dalei asked what she meant and explained that he was not that kind of person, and he didn't even go to a brothel in Chang'an. Lai Wanner ordered him to get into the carriage, he would wait there so she could see his head. Cheng Dalei questioned if that was necessary and said that they lacked the necessary trust between them. Suddenly, the bushes near the lake made a rustling sound. She dipped into the lake. Lai Wanner called Cheng Dalei's name, and he asked what was wrong and if she wanted him to hand her a towel. Lai Wanner replied no, it was nothing. She explained that it was too quiet there, and if no one was speaking, she felt as if she was the only one there. Cheng Dalei asked her what she wanted to talk about. She replied that there was nothing to talk about and asked what he meant by what he usually said because no one understands it. Cheng Dalei answered that it was a saying in his hometown, and even if he explained it to her, she wouldn't understand it. Once she moved out of her hometown, the people back home would always say different things about her, no matter what. Lai Wanner innocently replied that his hometown was Kin New Mountain. Suddenly, someone stepped out. She immediately panicked and asked who it was. When she realized who it was, she berated Cheng Dalei and called him a bastard. Cheng Dalei threw her a towel and said to hide because someone was coming, to which she received it silently. Someone said to Cheng Dalei that his hearing ability was really admirable. He introduced himself as Scholar Killer Ren Dedi. Scholar Killer greeted Cheng Dalei, and a description of him emerged that he was a famous top killer at age 38 with lethal scholar's sword skills. Cheng Dalei asked if there were no others under Minister Qi besides the Mute Scholar and the Scholar Killer because the Mute Scholar couldn't withstand a single move from him. Scholar Killer replied that Cheng Dalei could give it a try because he was not the same as him. He replied that there was no need to hurry and wait for everyone. Scholar Killer asked what he meant by waiting for everyone and questioned if there were others. Red-haired ghost Yuan Zhu chuckled, amazed by Cheng Dalei's skill, confirming that old Yuan had not misjudged him. A description revealed that Yuan Zhu was a renowned top pirate at the age of 42, known for his wild wave sword technique, and an experienced leader of the pirates of Liao Mountain. He was also arrogant, conceited, and mostly worked alone. Cheng Dalei stated that everyone was present, and there was no need to hide, they should reveal themselves. Another man emerged and mentioned that a monk had told him about Cheng Dalei's exceptional abilities. This man was named Zhu Shuang, known for his top martial artist skills at the age of 45, specializing in umbrella fighting, needle, and poison skills. Zhu Shuang was described as sinister, cunning, greedy for money and lust. He originated from the jungle and was recruited to be one of the 33 hidden dragon guards. Lai Wanner recognized Zhu Shuang and thought to herself that he belonged to the Merlian Guard. Cheng Dalei considered that the three of them were first class, which posed a problem since the body he occupied had been used a few hours ago. However, he replied that the winner would have the final say and suggested they play a round of mahjong. The scholar killer responded, saying that a murderer like him, who had killed countless people on his way, would not let Cheng Dalei stay in the world. Yuan Zhu remarked that he wasn't like them and wouldn't kill Cheng Dalei. He just wanted to take the princess away to become his wife. Zhu Shuang told Cheng Dalei that he was a bit confused because he didn't expect to leave there alive since people wanted to kill him. Cheng Dalei thought to himself that it appeared that, aside from him, they were unaware of each other's strengths, so they were wary of each other. He suggested not playing Mahjong and instead proposed a game of Fight the Landlord. Cheng Dalei was troubled by a headache as he made decisions. The scholar killer desired to kill him, the red-haired ghost aimed to take the princess, Skywalker sought to whisk away the princess and eliminate Cheng Dalei in the process, and Cheng Dalei wished to escort the princess to safety. He extended his finger toward the red-haired ghost, signifying that he should be the first to be dealt with, which left him puzzled. Cheng Dalei clarified that they all coveted the princess, and this pirate wished to make her his daughter-in-law. He additionally mentioned that the Merlian Guard would not permit the pirates to gain control of the princess, and he speculated that Minister Kui hadn't anticipated this situation. Zhu Shuang chuckled and suggested that they resolve the matter among themselves. The red-haired ghost referred to Cheng Dalei as a brat. He explained that they were mountain bandits and pirates, which could also be considered as peers. The two charged at each other with raised swords, and Cheng Dalei responded that peers were, in fact, adversaries. Cheng Dalei charged his way at the red-haired ghost, but the sword instantly turned and attacked the scholar killer. Cheng Dalei tried to strike him with his sword. Suddenly, he got blocked, and the scholar killer was amazed by his fast sword. He asked if he wanted to deal with him using lightning speed and laughed at Cheng Dalei that it was a pity that his wishful thinking was wrong. 
Scholar Killer and Cheng Dale exchanged an intense sword fight with each other. Scholar Killer called out to Zhu Shuang, asking what he was looking at, and they were all from the imperial court to which he implied killing Cheng Dale first. Zhu Shuang got his umbrella in position as he smiled sinisterly and said good. He launched his attack at Cheng Dale while he screamed for him to die and called him a bastard. Zhu Shuang activated his umbrella thrust spear, which was easily blocked by Cheng Dale. However, the red-haired ghost felt left out as he stood on the side and watched them fight. He questioned that no one was fighting him who should he fight. Scholar Killer and Zhu Shuang went on fighting desperately, wanting to kill Cheng Dale. Danger squeezed potential. Cheng Dale's experience against the enemy response was growing like crazy, and he thought in his head they were determined to join forces to kill him first. Cheng Dale activated his exploding fireworks which Scholar Killer and Zhu Shuang struggled with but could still fight him. He thought in his head that he was not sure if he could handle two of them, but if it was three, they would certainly win. Meanwhile, the red-haired ghost joined the fight while laughing at Cheng Dale for wanting the princess and not blaming him for not holding up marital virtue. Cheng Dale kept thinking the longer the fight, the greater physical exertion would be while blocking red-haired ghost's attacks. He realized that these three were by no means monolithic but now they shared a common goal. It was to kill Cheng Dale as Scholar Killer and Zhu Shuang aggressively prepared to launch their attacks. Cheng Dale was able to block Scholar Killer's sword but not Zhu Shuang's umbrella, and blood began to spill. He kept thinking he needed to get back as blood continued to splatter. Cheng Dale was pushed towards the lake by Zhu Shuang using his umbrella. Water splashed, and Lai Wanner was worried as she called Cheng Dale's name. Cheng Dale began sinking into the lake along with his sword in his hand. Lai Wanner looked back at Cheng Dale and wondered if he knew how to swim. Cheng Dale completely sank into the lake. Scholar Killer asked if they had successfully dealt with him, to which Zhu Shuang answered that he was poisoned by his umbrella. Even if he knew how to swim, he wouldn't live long. Seeing that these two were weaker than himself, the red-haired ghost took his chance to attack. Zhu Shuang told the Scholar Killer to join forces and kill the pirate, which he agreed to. The red-haired ghost launched his sword, said that it was now their turn to die, and that the princess was his. He activated his wild wave sword, which was blocked by Zhu Shuang and Scholar Killer. Underwater, Cheng Dale called the system and opened the store in exchange for antidote pills. He exchanged one antidote pill that could cure all types of poison in the world, which cost him 30 million fear points. The system spirit winked before asking what he was doing. Cheng Dale held his breath as he replied telepathically not to interrupt him because he was playing dead and asked her to take a look if the fight above was done. The system spirit replied that Scholar Killer and Skywalker were confronting the red-haired ghost, and it was going to take a while, and told him that he would never have expected that someone would come down. Lai Wanner swam down the lake while Cheng Dale was confused. He kept thinking who it was, who was grabbing his hand. Cheng Dale wondered if it could be Lai Wanner. He kept thinking that she was trying to save him. Cheng Dale knew they were still fighting to the death above, and if he went up now, they would immediately turn their attention to him and attack him. He decided that he was not going up. Lai Wanner was struggling and wondered if he was so heavy she couldn't pull him up. Cheng Dale thought in his head that he did not need to save him, and he wanted her to let go and go up there. However, Lai Wanner was determined and held Cheng Dale's face. This made him wonder if she was trying to give him oxygen. The red-haired ghost, scholar killer, and Zhu Shuang exchanged blows. Struggling, the red-haired ghost claimed that while fighting Cheng Dale, the two of them were hiding their clumsiness while he cursed at them under his breath. He had the impression that the scholar killer's sword skill was extremely sharp, like a violent storm, whereas Zhu Shuang's iron umbrella was made of an unknown material, and after cutting it, it didn't even leave a trace on it. As the Scholar Killer unleashed the Scholar's lethal sword, the red-haired ghost thought that their cooperation was so difficult for him to deal with. The red-haired ghost blocked every attack of the Scholar Killer, while Zhu Shuang splashed dark ink towards the red-haired ghost. The dark ink blinded the red-haired ghost, causing him to curse in his mind. The lethal sword lightning of Scholar Killer Scholar quickly stabbed the red-haired ghost on the throat. The red-haired ghost cursed at him on his last breath as he vomited blood. The arrogant red-haired ghost finally paid the price for his arrogance, as the scholar killer told him that he had done well, while beside him was Zhu Shuang standing. The scholar killer informed Zhu Shuang that he had come to kill Cheng Dale by the order of the minister, and now that the bandit was dead, he could escort Princess Ming Yu away. He told him that he would see him later, to which Zhu Shuang answered, please. The scholar killer walked away, passing Zhu Shuang. Then, out of nowhere, they both attacked each other. Scholar Killer swung his sword, but Zhu Shuang easily deflected it. Zhu Shuang retaliated by thrusting his umbrella at the Scholar Killer, who easily avoided it. 
They both continued as the grass beneath them moved. Zhu Shuang asked the scholar killer if Minister Qi had ordered him to kill Princess Minjiu, to which the scholar killer replied with a chuckle that Minister Qi did not want Princess Minjiu's life. He went on to say that at this time, saving Princess Minjiu and killing Cheng Dale would be great accomplishments, and that because he recognized him as a Merlian guard, he would certainly take all the credit in front of Emperor Ming alone and by killing him, he would take all the credit. Zhu Shuang replied that it would depend on whether or not he survived. The scholar killer asked him if he really thought he couldn't kill him. He unleashed scholar's lethal sword waterfall, but Zhu Shuang blocked it with his umbrella. He opened his umbrella no matter how heavy the rain was, it couldn't cover all of his body. The scholar killer thought that only a fast sword could break the umbrella defense. Zhu Shuang clicked something. He released the steel needle rain. The scholar killer was repeatedly stabbed with highly poisonous needles. He lost consciousness and vomited blood as he fell down. Zhu Shuang mumbled that he was more like a clown than a killer scholar. Princess Minjiu, meanwhile, swam towards Cheng Dale's unconscious body in the water. She swam closer to him, thinking she could still feel him reacting. She swam to the surface, believing she could save Cheng Dale. As she already saved him once, she was certain that she could save him twice, Princess Minjiu stated. Princess Minjiu arrived at the surface and took a breath. However, Zhu Shuang stood nearby and asked her what she was doing down there. Zhu Shuang readied his umbrella and assured Princess Minjiu not to be afraid as he would take her back. On the other hand, a few steel needles were ready. Princess Minjiu ordered him to go away, as she needed to put on her clothes first. Zhu Shuang squatted down and told her that the area was dangerous, and he did not feel comfortable leaving Princess Minjiu alone. Princess Minjiu yelled at him, telling him to go away. He grabbed Princess Minjiu's clothes and told her that she didn't need to curse and that he wasn't as good as a mountain bandit. He blushed as he smelled her clothes, saying they smelled good, worthy of the royal highness of the three cities, and the lovely and virtuous beauty whom everyone admires, and such a stunning beauty that even he would like. Princess Minjiu cursed him and asked if he was afraid of death if he was willing to betray Emperor Ming. Zhu Shuang informed her that he was from the country, and he would not be afraid to enter the country again. And as for Emperor Ming, he told her that he was just a mere clay statue. He told her why she shouldn't let him take her body right then. Then, all of a sudden, a man stated that he was choking to death. Cheng Dale walked to the ground and commented on how deep the lake was. Zhu Shuang, surprised, asked if he had not been poisoned to death. Cheng Dale pointed at him and said that he was about to die when an immortal gave him an immortal breath, and he came back to life, and he wanted Princess Minjiu to say it. Princess Minjiu blushed as she asked Cheng Dale if he could swim. Cheng Dale informed her that he was the second runner-up in the 400 trial on campus and asked her what was wrong because her expression was not quite good. Zhu Shuang informed him that he had already killed two, and he didn't mind killing another one, to which Cheng Dale questioned him. Cheng Dale took a stance and asked if he had heard of a move known as the straightforward sword technique. Cheng Dale asked Zhu Shuang if he knew how talented he was and how hard he worked in his spare time. Zhu Shuang believed that the Merlian guards had gathered information on everyone in the world and had a special investigation intel on Cheng Dali, and that since his birth, he had done many things that people couldn't do in their lifetime, and that he was possibly a genius who was good at fighting. Cheng Dali informed him that he didn't put in much effort because he only had a cheat, which puzzled Zhu Shuang. Zhu Shuang was stunned in a moment, as Cheng Dali's body moved radially, as still as a rock, unleashing the colorless double-winged phoenix. Cheng Dale moved like lightning as he charged towards Zhu Shuang. Zhu Shuang gritted his teeth as he realized that Cheng Dale was so fast. He was convinced that there was no time to open his umbrella and that he must be pushed back with a poison needle. Zhu Shuang realized that as long as he could open his umbrella, he couldn't get close. Cheng Dale released the two hearts beat as one skill, and he blocked all Zhu Shuang needles. Zhu Shuang was taken aback because Cheng Dale's speed had not been reduced at all. Cheng Dale unleashed Ulfei's sword and thrust through Zhu Shuang using the straightforward sword. Zhu Shuang's neck bled, and moments later blood spurted out as he fell down. Cheng Dale was gasping for air. He reasoned that using the fast sword while his right shoulder was injured was too harmful to his body. He held Zhu Shuang's umbrella and thought that it was nice stuff. A system information appeared, stating that it was a top concealed weapon, called a thousand machine iron umbrella. Cheng Dale walked towards Princess Minju and mentioned her name. He told her that he would get the carriage, that she should get dressed up, because others could soon find their way here. Princess Minju leaped out of the water and embraced Cheng Dale. She told him not to go. Cheng Dale reassured her that everything was okay and that they were all dead, so she didn't need to be afraid. 
He asked if she could still walk, and Princess Minju replied that he should carry her because the lake was too cold for her and her feet were numb. Cheng Dale said that Emperor Ming was a piece of shit for bringing the Merlian guards, but Princess Minju told him that she had harmed him and couldn't help him. He said it was okay, and she was just a mascot in this game of life and death, and his mission was to escort her away, and everyone wanted to fight for her, and no one could be trusted. He said that she could trust him. When Princess Minju asked what a mascot was, Cheng Dale replied that it was something cute and pretty but not very useful. She said that she didn't know what he meant by mascot, but she definitely wasn't one, to which Cheng Dale laughed. A group of horseback soldiers arrived the next day. The man in front halted his horse in front of the corpse. He said that it was incredible. As he mentioned the red-haired ghost, scholar killer, and Merlian guard Skywalker Zhu Shuang, he realized that all of them were first-class fighters in the country and were now dead. He informed his men that many experts died in his hands along the way, but this time was different, and his men inquired as to what the difference was. The man claimed that the other experts were all hit in the throat with a sword, but the fatal wound was not on the throat, except for Zhu Shuang. He assumed Cheng Dale's sword had slowed, and it appeared that he was injured and badly hurt, while his man asked him what he was waiting for and advised him to hurry up while Cheng Dale was still injured. The man wondered if Cheng Dale should have gone south instead of north if he wanted to return to the border. Butcher said it was probably because he knew there were people guarding the border and wanted to get to the extreme north to get away from the limelight first. He went on to say that going further was the Ring tribe's sphere of influence, and Cheng Dale could hide in the Ring's town, but he could also go west or bypass the town and sleep in the wild, to which the man replied that they would split their troops into two groups. He told Butcher to lead the people to the outskirts of the Ring's town and not to alert the Ring tribe army, and that he would lead people to the west, to which Butcher said yes. This was the neutral zone between the Ring tribe and the Empire, and it neither belonged to the Ring tribe nor was controlled by the Empire. It was a place where the merchants who had struggled to survive in the gap had to pass. It was also the land of horse bandits, murderers, and smugglers. Among those horse bandits, Butcher was perhaps not the strongest. An elderly man observed the charging horses. Butcher sliced the man as he passed right beside him. He laughed because Butcher was one of the most brutal. A voice said there was a small town ahead, while another said it was part of an unregulated zone which was a dangerous place, but they should be able to get some supplies and rest in the wild that night before going back in the morning. Cheng Dale motioned for Princess Minjiu to come closer, but Princess Minjiu was perplexed and wondered why he was taking his clothes off. He asked her to help him and warned her not to touch him anywhere and be gentle because he was bleeding. Princess Minjiu told him to be quiet as she was just redressing the wounds, to which Cheng Dale laughed. He asked Princess Minjiu if she knew how to dress wounds and if the princess could also serve others. She informed him that she had not dressed anyone before, but she could learn. Struggling, she told him that she could not tear it open. Princess Minjiu was irritated because she couldn't tear it open, so Cheng Dale advised her to be gentle. After a while, the bandage came off. Cheng Dale looked exhausted. Fuming, Princess Minjiu asked him what was with his face. Princess Minjiu noticed it was raining and told Cheng Dale to rest first, and she would keep watch that night. Cheng Dale slept, and beside her, Princess Minjiu kept on looking out. She pondered that it was so dark outside. But as she realized that inside the carriage, she stated that she had always felt a sense of peace of mind. Then, all of a sudden, a horse's hoof clattered on the ground. Princess Minju's eyes widened as she heard noises, and as she peeked outside the carriage, she saw silhouettes of horseback riders charging towards them. Princess Minju yelled, realizing that it was them. However, Cheng Dale grabbed her shoulders and told her to shush. He advised her to stay in the carriage. Cheng Dale told her to wait for him. Princess Minju said nothing. She peeked out of the carriage and watched Cheng Dale confronting the bandits. Cheng Dale told her to get inside and close the curtain and not to come out, and not to show her face. The bandits yelled that they found them and ordered everyone to kill him, and that the princess was there. Butcher led his men and ordered them to kill the man and take away the woman. Suddenly, Hart appeared and told Cheng Dale that they were going to end it quickly, to which he agreed. Cheng Dale charged at the bandits with a thunderous aura. The wolves chased the sheep, but the sheep curled up on the ground and turned into a male lion. The aura of a single man, but it felt like that of a group. The blade of the sword came and went piercing the rain curtain and spraying beads of blood. Cheng Dale took a stance below the butcher, as both of them stared at each other. Cheng Dale killed people like mowing the lawn. The rain was getting heavier. Princess Minju sat down inside the carriage. She was left in the darkness, surrounded by empty silence, and the only sound was the rain. 
She frowned as she thought that it was so dark and cold, and she didn't know if Cheng Dale could defeat the opponents. After all, he was only one person and after another chaotic battle, his body could not recover until that time. She went silent for a moment and grabbed her shoulders. A man opened the curtains and Princess Minji asked who it was. Wounded, Cheng Dale addressed himself and told her that he had killed some and that a few had escaped. He wanted to go after them, but he was afraid she would be scared. So he came back first, and he found some dried meat and wine on them, and he asked her if she was hungry and that she could eat something first. Princess Minju felt relieved as he mentioned Cheng Dale's name. Cheng Dale smirked and asked if she was scared, telling her not to be. As he lost consciousness he told her that he was with her. Concerned, Princess Minju told him to wake up and wondered what was going on with him. After a while, as the grass swayed in the breeze, Cheng Dale grabbed his sword. As he expressed his pain, tears fell down his cheeks. Princess Minju told him that he was an idiot. She expressed her confusion as to why he fought so hard for her when he was just a mountain bandit. She went on to say that he was not like other bandits and she thought he would just snatch her away. But at the end of the day, he decided to escort her to the ring camps. Princess Minju asked him why because she couldn't figure him out, to which Cheng Dale addressed her name. Cheng Dale asked her if she really wanted him to kidnap her like that, and he wondered if it was her choice that she get married away from home, to which she disagreed. He went on to say that based on how he saw her earlier, she seemed pretty serious, and when she said she would marry for the sake of the country and the people in exchange for five years of stability in the empire, he wondered if all those words were empty. Cheng Dale chuckled and stated that the journey was long, but there were more than one way to get where they wanted to go, and he knew what her goal was and what she wanted to do. He assured Princess Minjiu that he would take her there and help her to achieve what she wanted to do, and he informed her that they would get back on the road. In a run downtown in the middle of the steppe, a carriage arrived. Cheng Dale informed Princess Minjiu that there should have been a small market there. He noticed that there were some traders who bought animal hides, lambs, and mare's milk in exchange for goods, claiming that they could get some supplies there. He told her not to come out, to stay in the carriage, and to keep her face covered because it was a lawless zone, a stomping ground for horse bandits, criminals, and slave traders. After they finished their purchase, they left without staying a moment longer, to which Princess Minju said, okay. One of the traders noticed a foreign face, one of them asked if they could get money out of him, while the other warned him not to mess with him. They wondered what was in the carriage that drew the horse bandits, while others said that if they saw the bodies of the horse bandits outside, it had to have been Cheng Dale who did it, while others doubted that the wanderer died by his hands. The man stated that he looked like a buskill, while the old man said nothing. The old man took a peek and realized, the wanderer's umbrella was on Cheng Dale's back, and it appeared that the wanderer died by his hand. Cheng Dale and Princess Minju walked around the town. They arrived at a store where the owner asked them what they needed, and informed them that there were casinos and brothels nearby, as well as good wine and girls. Cheng Dale told him that he needed staple food, water, and jerky. The owner began to sweat as he realized he was covered in blood and wondered if he had just killed someone, and he asked him to please wait a moment. From time to time, there were people always glaring like a tiger eyeing its prey. And finally, no one dared to take the lead and could only watch Cheng Dale leave. The carriage continued forward until they arrived at a man sitting on a rock. The man asked Cheng Dale where he got the umbrella. Cheng Dale told him that there were umbrellas all over the street and wondered how he could recognize that the umbrella was related to him. The man stated that it was Zhu Shuang's umbrella, which made his reputation, and that he could only get it if he killed him, to which Cheng Dale asked him if he was his friend and since it was a relic of the deceased, he would return it to him. Mo Zhengren stated that he made the umbrella for him and that the final payment had not yet been made. He chuckled and stated that now that he had killed him, he could not pay the remaining balance. A system information popped up stating Mo Zhengren information who had the title gambler, and at the of 48 he was a famous first-class Mohis school mechanism with a great reputation. Cheng Dale said he'd pay it for him and asked how much he owed him. Mo Zhengren replied that there was no need to do so because he killed him and it now belongs to him, not until he kills him. Cheng Dale thought Mo Zhengren was so strong and said that if he wasn't mistaken, it was no fun fighting and killing. When he mentioned that he was the gambler ghost that everyone in the country was talking about, he wondered if he wanted to bet with him. He wondered if gambler ghost was willing to gamble and never retract on his debts, which prompted Mo Zhengren to ask if he actually knew his name, and he assumed that he had been hiding for years and the world had forgotten it. Cheng Dale stepped down and said that was good. Mo Zhengren stated that killing him directly was not fun and suggested that they make a bet, to which Cheng Dale asked him what he wanted to bet on. 
he stated that one game would determine the winner and if he won, he would let him go and give him the umbrella. And if he lost, he would have taken his life and all his things. According to Mo Zhengren, this included the woman in the carriage. Cheng Dalei disagreed, saying that the stakes were not equal, and if he really wanted to make a bet, he should have let him choose what to bet, to which he said sure. Cheng Dalei stated that guessing big or small was too boring, and he found a fun new way to gamble that he had never played before, and he wasn't sure if he was interested. Curious, Mo Zhengren asked what the fun way to gamble was, and he could say it. Cheng Dale asked him if he had heard of Monopoly and told him that there were 100 steps from here to the dead tree ahead, and that each person would roll the dice and take a step forward, and the first person to touch the tree would win. He sliced the ground and stated that they would start with the line he drew. Mo Zhengren, impressed, praised Cheng Dale's swordsmanship, telling him he wasn't bad. Mo Zhengren stated that because he had chosen the gambling method, he would take the first move, to which Cheng Dale responded with a chuckle, saying that gamblers didn't want to be taken advantage of. Mo Zhengren told him that the casino didn't talk to him, and on he rolled the dice. It landed on six dots. Mo Zhengren released the Yan Yan 18 overturn and leaped towards the field. He laughed at Cheng Dale, telling him that he was going to lose. Cheng Dale examined the dice and concluded that it weighed about a hundred pounds and was not made of ordinary iron. He threw the dice, and it landed on two dots, to which Mo Zhengren laughed, stating that he was being left behind. Then suddenly, Cheng Dale leaped twice. Princess Minju peeked outside and mentioned Cheng Dale's name. In the next round, Mo Zhengren rolled the dice and said that although he was good at swordsmanship, he was still going to lose. The dice rolled a couple of times, and until it landed on six dots again, Mo Zhengren ran while laughing. He was just inches from the tree as he told Cheng Dale that the beautiful woman in the carriage would be his. Cheng Dale inquired whether Mo Zhengren was truly willing to admit defeat and never seek revenge, to which Mo Zhengren replied that he would be willing to admit defeat but never seek revenge. Cheng Dale stated that it was his turn to roll the dice and he did so once more. The dice landed on five dots. Cheng Dale took a step. In his second step, he released the colorless double-winged phoenix and jumped into the sky. He landed and proceeded to the third step. He leaped repeatedly, reaching the fourth step. Princess Minju had declared that he was flying upwards. Mo Zhengren appeared puzzled. On Cheng Dale's fifth step, he initially reached the dead tree. Mo Zhengren believed it was all over. He instructed Cheng Dale not to become overconfident because it was now his turn to roll the dice, and he would lose. Cheng Dale disagreed, asserting that he had already won. Mo Zhengren questioned when he had won since he hadn't even touched the tree. Cheng Dale retorted, telling Mo Zhengren to look under his feet. Mo Zhengren's eyes widened as he realized that the tree roots were also part of the tree. Cheng Dale informed him that the winner had been determined. He pointed his sword at him and said that if he admitted defeat, he would let him go. He continued, stating that if he refused to admit defeat, he would send him to Zhu Shuang, causing Mo Zhengren to pause. Mo Zhengren scoffed and contemplated Cheng Dale's swordsmanship and lightning skills. He turned to Cheng Dale and acknowledged that he was good, admitting defeat and stating that he could inquire if he had ever reneged on his word. He walked away, stating that he couldn't frame him to break the rules. Cheng Dale let out a heavy sigh. He turned towards the carriage, gasping for breath. He opened the curtain and informed Princess Minju that they were going to depart. Gasping for breath, Cheng Dale lost consciousness, causing Princess Minju to become concerned. Cheng Dale informed her that he was feeling a little cold, but Princess Minju panicked and kept calling his name. On a cloudy, dark sky, a herd of horses marched by. The man stated that another group of his men died at the hands of Cheng Dale, as he scoffed, claiming that it was a clean slaughter that took him less than half an hour. He wondered what was wrong with his sword and if he was hurt. He claimed that Cheng Dale sharpened his sword with human heads, and that the grassland became his millstone. The man wondered why he was fleeing to Ring territory and assumed he was taking Princess Minju away to join the Ring tribe. He smiled and told his men to keep searching the area, and if they found him, to keep an eye on them and call for reinforcements. He warned them not to go off alone and die in vain, to which they said yes. The man gave the order to catch Cheng Dale before he could enter the ring's area. The horse bandits in the grasslands became like packs of hyenas. They confiscated the grasslands with an immoderate form of hunting, and when they were in a group, even lions had to avoid them. After a while, the sky began to darken. Cheng Dale was sick, and he lost too much blood, he did not sleep for days, and worked intensively for days, and predictably became ill. Princess Minju tried to wake Cheng Dale by repeatedly calling his name, and she cursed the carriage for being unable to block the water and rain. 
She went on to say that his forehead was on fire and his body was cold, whereas Cheng Dale's body was on fire and his eyelids were like heavy mountains. Princess Minju pondered what she should do and what the royal physician would do if he had been present when she was sick in the past. Whereas Cheng Dale mentioned Zin and mumbled about putting anti-inflammatory and antipyretic drugs in his sleep. Princess Minju sobbed as she wondered who he was calling and who Zin was. She also wondered if he couldn't think properly because of the fever. Concerned, she called Cheng Dale once more. Cheng Dale responded that he was fine after he got a good night's sleep. However, a clattering noise was heard outside the carriage. Princess Minju's face darkened because she realized it was the sounds of horse hooves. She stuttered, informing Cheng Dale that the horse bandits were coming. The horse bandits laughed as they yelled that they had found them, and someone ordered that someone be sent back to inform the village master. They were given the order to attack and surround them. Cheng Dale inquired of Zin whether she could still possess. Heart appeared, informing Cheng Dale that his body could no longer afford it, and when he was too forcibly possessed, he would just pass out at the end of the possession, to which Cheng Dale said that it didn't matter. Princess Minju addressed Cheng Dale and requested that he hand over his sword to her. She stated that if she had not forgotten what her swordsmanship teacher had taught her, she bit the handle of the sword. Princess Minju tied her hair into a ponytail. She stood up and left Cheng Dale behind her back. Cheng Dale addressed Princess Minju. Princess Minju stood tall as she opened the curtains. Cheng Dale wondered if it was still the Princess Minju he had known. System information about Princess Minju, originally named Lai Wan and nicknamed Princess Minju at the age of 18, appeared. When one of the horse bandits informed his men that the village master wanted to capture them alive, he ordered them to capture Cheng Dale because it was okay for them to be crippled and have their hamstrings slit. Princess Minju slashed them, and a sharp light began to charge at them. She unleashed the cut of the returning swallows towards the horse bandits, as she mentioned Cheng Dale's name. Princess Minju stated that although she didn't know what his so-called mascot was, she told him that she was really not a mascot. In the back, Cheng Dale yelled Princess Minju's name. He told her to watch out because one of the horse bandits was about to attack her. Princess Minju blocked the attack. She used her skill, the medium stitch. The sword skill was stored in her mind, but she did not use it. At that moment, it was activated. She cut off the returning swallows, and it wasn't her mind that remembered them, but her body. As she held the sword tightly, she released the vapor surge. She cut the horse bandits with the three tributes by the disciple. Princess Minju was in a trance. She remembered her early childhood when she was taught swordsmanship by her master. She laughed at her master's hairpin because it looked like an incense burner. However, at that moment, she regretted that she had not learned and remembered more. It turned out that all the things she learned could be useful at some point, even if she could only use them once. Between clashing swords, even Princess Minju herself didn't expect to last that long. However, the enemy was large in number, and with their splashing faces and the light from their swords, she became even more dazzled. Princess Minju's hand was supported by another hand from the handle. Cheng Dale possessed with heart supported Princess Minju. He told her that her sword wasn't fast enough, advised her to be fast and even faster. The carriage horse neighed. The horse bandits yelled to kill. Panicking, Princess Minju told Cheng Dale that they were coming. On the other hand, Cheng Dale told her not to panic. He told her to hold the hilt tight, and as they slashed, the sword turned into rain, and burst forth from a point and pierced the thick rain. He told Princess Minju that they were going to break out. The carriage charged at the horse bandit at full speed. The village master on top of the hill stated that if he ran away, he would not lose face. He ordered his men to put on the iron wire to stop them. The horse bandits coordinated as they were about to trap them. Cheng Dale slashed through the wire. He cursed as he realized what the rope was. His face darkened because he claimed that it couldn't be cut. The wire got their horse trapped, and the whole carriage was entrapped. The horse bandits were told to pull. Cheng Dale hugged Princess Minju to brace for the impact. The carriage escaped from the trap, but it tilted. The village master smiled as he watched the carriage fall. The carriage wheel rumbled as it spun incessantly. Cheng Dale caressed Princess Minju inside the carriage. Wounded, Princess Minju woke up. She noticed Cheng Dale and addressed his name. She repeatedly woke him up and called out his name. The lottery machine informed Hart that Cheng Dale was dying, to which Hart sighed and expressed her worries about him because he simply loved to stand up for others. She informed the lottery machine that she would give him access to a part of the system, and he would be responsible for maintaining it in her absence. The lottery machine inquired about what she was up to. The lottery machine asked her if she was going to exploit another bug and expressed his concern. 
He informed her that she would be banned by the system itself if she continued. Hart started the possession, and the system warned that the possession's cooldown had not yet ended. Another warning appeared, stating that multiple possessions in a short period of time could lead to the host's fragile soul being assimilated into the higher consciousness of the system's sprite. While Hart instructed Cheng Dale to open his heart, the system stated that any hint of resistance from the host would cause irreparable damage to both parties, as the form of possession would be the descent of consciousness, but Hart insisted on lending his body to her. As the horse bandits surrounded them and yelled that they couldn't escape, a system message popped up stating that all possessions would consume all fear points. Another notification appeared announcing that the possession was complete, and this time it was the descent of consciousness, with no time limit. Cheng Dale coughed loudly, and Princess Minjiu informed him that they had no other options given that the horse bandits were approaching. Cheng Dale told her to be quiet. He informed her that there was a way to do it. He told her that and so on and so forth as he caressed her head. Confused, Princess Minjiu blushed. She told him that even after all of this, he was still thinking about taking advantage of her, to which Cheng Dale replied that it was difficult to explain. But he remembered the last time. Princess Minjiu inquired as to how such a method could be possible. She grabbed his clothes and called him an idiot. Blushing, Princess Minjiu threatened to kill him if it didn't work. Cheng Dale was taken aback. Then moments later, the two of them kissed. A system notification popped up, stating that an abandoned mission of capturing a wife had been resumed, and the conditions were met, as well as the completion of the first phase of capturing a wife, with the reward being one raffle entry. It went on and said that the system Sprite Zin had requested a new mission reward, and it went on to say that the administrator Zin intervened in the mission reward, and the mission reward was replaced. Another message appeared informing Hart that the mission reward was adjusted from one raffle entry to a godfall buff, and the system also warned that the system sprite could only mobilize the power of the system if he met certain system conditions, which made Hart wonder which buff was better. She muttered something about this one fitting the bill. Hart held an orb and stated that they should repair the body first. Then a system notification popped up stating that the host had received a buff, and it was the princess's blessing, which completed the restoration of the body's condition and elimination of negative conditions, as well as a short-term increase in speed and strength. Cheng Dale informed Princess Minjiu that that was enough. Princess Minjiu closed her eyes and wondered. She opened them. Cheng Dale advised her to stay, to which Princess Minjiu asked him about his injury and what was going on. Cheng Dale kicked his sword and told her that it was hard for him to explain, and he could interpret it as her kiss being the medicine for healing. Princess Minjiu inquired about what he said about her being a medicine that could heal. Hart chimed in, stating that it was not a cure, but for her, she could say it was a medicine. Princess Minjiu yelled and told Cheng Dale to watch out. A group of horse bandits attacked. However, Cheng Dale intercepted them and charged through them. Cheng Dale mumbled that he should not have interfered in his affairs as the horse bandits were sent flying. He went on to say that who could help it now that they had become close partners whose lives and souls were intertwined. And if they wanted to kill Cheng Dale, the system sprite would have to come and save the day, which made the man wonder what he was talking about. Hart stated that after the rescue, she had to stay in a banned place, which annoyed her at the time, and that things had to be dealt with completely because it was easy for her to descend. She threatened them that she would clean them up. The horse bandits were ordered to kill Cheng Dale, while others wondered how a single person could be so conceited. Cheng Dale slid towards them. He charged, and Hart informed him that they had to go because a substitution was now online. She also stated that she would kill all those pesky horse bandits. She went on to say that it was a rainy night that night, right down to the last one of them. The hunters chased the wounded lion, and the lion's skin was torn open and blood splattered everywhere. When the hunters looked in the cage, they discovered that they were trapped. The lion took on the form of a butcher, struggling. The man mumbled that his sword technique was not Cheng Dale's sword technique, realizing that it was the fastest sword ever. He claimed that his opponent was not Cheng Dale because he used sword techniques that were so fast they didn't appear to be human. Cheng Dale slashed through him while spurting out from the man's body. As he breathed his last, the man wondered who he was. The horse bandits realized that their village master was dead and told everyone to avenge him and kill Cheng Dale. 5,000 horse bandits under Gui Giant whose command were killed in one rainy night by a single man and scattered to the winds. The largest group of horse bandits in the grasslands who were under Gui Giant who had fallen. As Cheng Dale cut through a skeletal mask, all that remained were the rumors about the rainy night and the sword techniques. A voice groaned as two golden orbs were about to collide. Cheng Dale awoke to find himself in the system space and wondered how he got there again. 
he thought that he remembered the car rolling over before he passed out, sweating. He wondered if that meant he simply died like that and that he expected victory and defeat to be commonplace for the young warrior to restart. He also wondered if he could still read files. The lottery machine appeared and asked how he felt and if his soul had no damage, to which he responded by asking where Hart was and where she had gone. The lottery machine informed him that Hart had taken control of his body the previous night and killed many horse bandits. He went on and said that she was banned by the system and now she sat in a small dark room writing an apology. Cheng Dale inquired as to what happened last night. The lottery machine told him the details of how he had asked Princess Minju for a kiss were omitted, which Cheng Dale deduced. The lottery machine told him that he had been too dependent on the power Hart had given him lately, which was not good. Cheng Dale, on the other hand, laughed it off and responded that he couldn't help himself because it was too beautiful not to cheat, to which lottery machine replied that he knew it was cool to have the power to destroy everything, but he had to understand. He reminded Cheng Dale that that power was never his own. He informed him that he recently puffed himself up, gained power, and became ruthless in the process. Lottery Machine inquired as to whether he forgot that he still carried the hopes of others. He went on to mention his friends, his lover, and even the system, as well as the sprite who was heart. He reminded him that it was a chaotic world and that it was not a game, that individual bravery did not solve all problems, and that even the system was sometimes helpless. He also stated that as long as he lived in the world of chaos, he had to put his life on the line and bet everything he had. Now that she was banned and in a small black room, he could not use the possession function for the time being. And if Hart abused her power in that way, the system would accelerate the birth of another sprite. As soon as the new sprite was born, Hart's system access would be partially shared. He reminded him that Hart liked him and that there were things she didn't want to say, but that after the near-death experience, perhaps he should learn a lesson, for which Cheng Dale apologized. As he woke up, he saw a silhouette of a woman. Cheng Dale slowly opened his eyes. Princess Minju was about to kiss him when she leaned in closer. Cheng Dale asked her what she was doing. She stuttered and realized he was awake. Princess Minju blushed. She told him that she saw he was not awake yet and thought that she could wake him up. Cheng Dale complained that his head hurt and asked how long he had been sleeping, to which she replied that it had only been one day and one night. Princess Minju asked if he was hungry or tired and if he wanted to sleep some more, to which Cheng Dale replied that he was okay and that all he needed was water. But Princess Minju informed him that they had run out of water, but she still had some dried food. As the carriage began to rumble, Cheng Dale told her that they were going to get going and move on. Cheng Dale sat in front of the carriage. He realized that the lottery machine was right and he also realized that the only way to be seen as strong was to have his own power. As Princess Minju stuck her head out from behind the curtain, he believed it was time to practice his martial arts and improve his strength when he was done with the matter. Princess Minju looked up and wondered if he was healthy and felt better after kissing him, and he was able to kill all those horse bandits in only one day and one night despite his injuries. She couldn't believe Cheng Dale stood in front of her as a living example, and she wondered what that meant. She remembered how similar it was in the water back then. She wondered if kissing him had truly healed him, and their journey was still going on. Snatching the princess became a significant event in the martial arts world. The country's people who returned from the grasslands alive participated in spreading all kinds of gossip. A voice asked if they heard that the mountain bandit Cheng Dale snatched the princess, to which the other replied that they were not well informed and that it had been more than 10 days since the snatching. A man arrived, announcing that something big had happened, that 5,000 horse bandits were massacred. The crowd was skeptical and told him that it was a fake, wondering who could have killed the ghost. The man told them that he heard that the sorrowful ghost coveted Cheng Dale's sword manual, and that he was chasing him with 5,000 horse bandits, and as a result, he was killed by Cheng Dale with one sword and through his armor. And another asked what the sword manual was and why he still coveted sword manuals because the sorrowful ghost's sword was so fast. Yet the man retorted that the escaped horse bandit told them that their village master had been reading the sword manual. The curious crowd wondered what kind of secret manual it was because they believed Cheng Dale could use the five thunder technique and wondered if that was what the sword manual was about. While another chimed in, stating that he believed the sword manual was real, and that was why mountain bandits could rise so rapidly. Another customer told them what nonsense the sword manual they were talking about because he believed it was a forbidden technique. And another man also joined in their conversation. Slowly, a rumor spread in the country that Cheng Dale was carrying a peerless martial arts secret manual, and the more it spread, the more outrageous it became. Eavesdropping, 
Su Shenji mumbled that Cheng Dale really was worthy of being their village master. Kin Man stood up and informed Zhu Shenji that they were going back to the Hulu Mountain, to which Zhu Shenji asked if he didn't want to learn more. Kin Man stated that Cheng Dale would live and die in the grassland, and when their toad village brothers had almost gathered, he suggested that they go to the grasslands. Cheng Dale and his men entered the territory of the Ring Tribe, and the pursuers were afraid to search in the Ring Tribe territory. And on the vast grassland, finding two people was like finding two grains of sesame seeds in a grass field. Princess Minju asked Cheng Dale if they could go there. As Princess Minju and Cheng Dale continued their journey, two people in the grassland saw a sea of flowers everywhere in the mountains. Saw the sea of flowers flooded with butterflies filling the sky. Princess Minju smiled as she had fun playing with the butterfly. They encountered more tough people than the sorrowful ghost of the horse bandits. Princess Minju also met the Ring tribe's kind and enthusiastic ordinary civilians. As the man told Princess Minju a story that he used to be a guard beside the Ring tribe's king until he was shot in the knee with an arrow. The two strangers shared a story about how the Ring tribe king was really something, and how he liked to play with women he snatched in his palace late at night. The man went on to say that if the Ring Tribe King didn't try to rob his dear Alma, they wouldn't have had to flee inside the city. He also informed them that if they went to the royal city, he knew a secret passage in the palace where they could avoid the guards. He told them that they used to use that secret passage to date his dear Alma. The man stated that that was how he escaped, but Cheng Dale said nothing. Around the campfire, listening to the love story of Ring's couple, and saying goodbye to the Ring's couple, the two of them drove the carriage in the grassland slowly, without realizing it and walked for more than ten days. Cheng Dale was in shock. Meng Zhilao was sitting on the grass field when Cheng Dale approached him and told him that they had met again. Meng Zhilao ignored him and continued chanting. Cheng Dale approached him. He asked Meng Zhilao what he was saying, to which the monk responded that too many people had died in the grasslands. He informed him that he was praying for them to be reincarnated soon. Cheng Dale asked if it was working, to which Meng Zhilao responded that he wasn't quite sure. Cheng Dale asked what he was doing here, and Meng Zhilao replied that Emperor Ming had ordered him to take Princess Minju and get rid of him. Cheng Dale, on the other hand, resisted, saying that he wouldn't give Princess Minju to him and that he wouldn't stand by and watch him kill her, so he suggested they both fight. Meng Zhilao responded that monks do not kill. Then his palm shone, telling Cheng Dale that Emperor Ming's orders couldn't be disobeyed. Cheng Dale sweated and had his eyes wide open. Meng Zhilao unleashed his infinitely compassionate and merciful palm technique. His palm was so fierce that Cheng Dale even felt that he would be directly killed in one strike. But in the end, he found out that as soon as King Yi Buddha palm power was withdrawn, Cheng Dale only felt a butt mound in the end, as his sword was spiraling above Meng Zhilao. It was now almost on his arm. Cheng Dale's sword cut Meng Zhilao's fingers. Suddenly, two of Meng Zhilao's fingers vanished, and his rosary beads snapped. Cheng Dale asked him why he was doing this. Meng Zhilao responded that if he took a slap from him, he could exact revenge for teasing him in the heavenly prison, and he could also return to Emperor Ming with his two fingers broken. He went on to say that now that he was a demon, the entire world would try to kill him. But in a world where everyone was fighting to eat each other, no one was chanting the sutras or praying to Buddha. Meng Zhilao believed that perhaps what was lacking was a demon benefactor. Cheng Dale shared a tale with Wanner as they stood by the shores of the sacred lake known as Daughter Lake, to the Ring Tribe. He described that across the lake was the royal city of the Ring Tribe, where they could see the tribe's king, Hu Yan Ba and he informed Wanner that they were likely to be there tomorrow, adding that she still had a day to decide whether she wanted to join or not. While Wanner's eyes showed a sense of contemplative silence, Wanner, driven by curiosity, questioned Cheng Dale about his knowledge of the grassland legends about the Daughter Lake. Intrigued, Cheng Dale inquired about the legend. Pointing towards the lake, Wanner embarked on the tale of the Ring tribe's ancestors. She spoke of a young shepherdess who gave birth to a boy while herding sheep. Unmarried at the time, the shepherdess was kicked by her parents, forcing her to wander the grassland with her baby. Tears streamed down her face as she walked, and her tears became more abundant and finally became the daughter of Lake. Wanner continued the narrative, describing how the child was born and later became the leader of the rings. He unified the people of the grassland, leading them to withstand the storms, managing their herds of cattle and sheep, and mentioning that became the first heroes of the grassland. Cheng Dale expressed his amazement, describing it as quite an epic sensation. His incredulous comment about the significance of unmarried pregnancy could be a big deal. Wanner was momentarily speechless. Wanner noted that being born into an imperial family would not help herself, and hoped that once she got married, the empire would use the time to recuperate. 
With a heartfelt plea, she expressed her desire for the two nations to stop fighting in the future, in hopes that Cheng Dale remembered her sacrifice. Wanner relates her story to the Shepherdess, acknowledging that the Shepherdess was born with disgrace. However, she is written into the legends after her death. Cheng Dale, casting a gentle glance at Wanner, urged her not to think so much. He assured her that by tomorrow, everything would come to an end. Resting her head on Cheng Dale's shoulder, Wanner agreed with him that the next day everything would be over. Cheng Dale carried Wanner with utmost gentleness to the awaiting carriage. He put her carefully inside and observed her peaceful slumber. As the evening unfolded, the night sky was full of stars and the first snowfall. Wanner woke from her slumber with a soft sound. She began searching for Cheng Dale and peered out from the carriage while calling his name. Unable to find him, she decided to step out of the carriage. As the sky was full of stars, the starlight-like dot reflected on the lake, and the cold dew rose on the weeds. And there's Wanner walked into the open field while searching for Cheng Dale. Wanner worry was evident on her face as she feared his absence in the sky that was covered with darkness and cold swept away. Meanwhile in the Ring Tribe Royal City, that day marked the Vulcan Festival of the Ring Tribe, and a grand celebration unfolded in the city. Everyone gathered together to celebrate the festivities, offering prayers for abundant water, grass, and cattle and sheep in the coming year. Amidst the joyous celebration, the king of the Ring Tribe, Hu Yanba, a male figure with only an interest in women. He turned to Yanli and told him that they could just go have fun. He added that he wanted to rest early that night. Yanli bowed in acknowledgement of his father's words. Following that moment, Hu Yanba made his way to his room, where the guards respectfully greeted him. Hu Yanba instructed the guards to leave, as there was no important business that night, and told them that he didn't want to be disturbed. The guards affirmed his order. Hu Yanba is fond of women. He must have a young girl in bed with him every night, and he likes to snatch other people's wives and daughters. He does not like others interfering in his hobby. Hu Yamba slowly approached his bed, calling the woman beauty in a perverted manner. With a grin on his face that showed his golden tooth, he pervertedly said that he came. A sly smile on Cheng Dale's face as he turned to Hu Yanba and greeted him, to which Hu Yanba's face contorted and flabbergasted. Without hesitation, Cheng Dale stabbed Hu Yanba in his chest, who was visibly shocked. Cheng Dale seriously observed Hu Yanba's fallen demeanor. He pondered the festival atmosphere among the ring's people and the slacking of the guards, emphasizing that day was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Recalling his uncle's words about a secret passage leading to the palace, he questioned whether Hu Yamba still feared being caught playing with women. While undressing, he contemplated how the escape route left by the king had unwittingly turned into a path to his death. Expressing gratitude to the woman he had tied up, Cheng Dale bid her goodbye and thanked her for the clothing. He noted to himself that it wasn't easy to dress up as a woman. While the woman looked at him in terror, exiting the king's chamber, Cheng Dale continued to reflect on how things progressed better than he thought, finding the purpose that dressing up as a woman was not in vain. He pondered his next step, retreating through the secret passage, swiftly leaping outside of the Ring tribe territory without drawing attention. Wanner sat down in the open field under the bright crescent moon. Actually, Wanner didn't want to go to the royal city of the rings at all. But as a princess, she had to do it. She had to sacrifice herself for the peace of the two countries. Since the day she left Chang'an, the playful, headstrong, and naive Wanner died. As a child, Wanner was mischievous, until Cheng Dale appeared in front of her and showed her another way. Wanner, who was dead inside, came back to life. She woke up a little angry, screamed, and said to herself that she didn't want to do it. She cried pitifully, cursing as she wiped her tears. Wanner insulted Cheng Dale as an idiot and couldn't believe that he left her without saying goodbye. Covering her face while crying, she questioned why he pretended to be a great nationalist and wondered why he couldn't change anything. He had given her hope. She persisted in hurling insults at Cheng Dale, questioning why he kidnapped her only to leave her in that place. Urging Cheng Dale to be brave, she implored him to take her along, vehemently expressing her unwillingness to marry into the rings. But such capricious words could only be said by Wanner, which still lingered deep in her heart. Now Cheng Dale left without saying goodbye, so Wanner had to be sacrificed again. And only Wanner resigned to her fate for the common good at dawn it was time for her to leave. As she stood up, she noticed in the distance a galloping horse was coming. In a hurry, Cheng Dale, who rode the horse, urged Wanner to hurry, fearing they would be too late if they didn't leave. Upon reaching Wanner, Cheng Dale leaped off his horse and instructed her once again to mount it, emphasizing that they no longer needed the carriage. Suddenly, he lifted Wanner, instructing her again to get on the horse. Wanner puzzled and questioned Cheng Dale about what he was up to. She asked him what he was doing last night, 
Cheng Dale gazed at her and informed her that Hu Yanba was dead and the Ring Tribe would fall into chaos. Suddenly, the system emerged from the band room, excitedly announcing that she had finally gotten out. While Cheng Dale hastily fled from the pursuing group of the Ring Tribe, he asked Wanner if she wanted five years of peace in the Empire. Casually, he mentioned that he was granting her five years of peace. At the same time, the system congratulated Cheng Dale for a great job and a beep sound from the system that he completed the mission and obtained a reward. The reach of influence is extended from a single person to the entire battlefield. When morning arrived in a different location, Lu Ju inquired whether Cheng Dale did not enter the territory of the rings. Sternly, Tong Fei confirmed that the ring wanted to kill Cheng Dale, and they did. She suspected that if Cheng Dale went deeper into the grasslands, there was only one option for him, to die. Lu Ju reacted, wondering why they hadn't encountered Cheng Dale yet. Tong Fei explained that the main roads back to the border were heavily guarded and that they needed to search as soon as they could catch him. Suddenly, in the distance, Tong Fei's men called for their attention to deliver a report. He informed them that Cheng Dale was right in front of them, coming with Wanner. Lu Ju was surprised and asked whether Cheng Dale gave up on his own. However, Tong Fei questioned the panic of his men, who frantically explained that behind Cheng Dale were the ringers, who were also attacking. Panic, the soldier informed them that Cheng Dale led the attacking ringers cavalry toward them. Some expressed their surprise, questioning that Cheng Dale defected to the rings. On the opposite side, the ringers charged towards them with determination. Lu Ju was fired up when he commanded the Carp Dragon Guards, proclaiming that they were the strongest army in the empire. He declared that the time had come to show the honor of the Carp Dragon Guards. They moved forward to attack as well. Amidst the approaching clash, Wanner clung tightly to Cheng Dale, expressing fear as she commented that they were squeezed from both the front and the back. As they tried to escape, Cheng Dale urged his AE-86 to sprint up to the mountain. Wanner's face was filled with fear as she told Cheng Dale that they were surrounded, urgently asking him where they should run to. Cheng Dale replied that the flank was the least crowded, advising that they should attempt to break the siege from there. Doubtful, Wanner asked if they could break through. In response, Cheng Dale told her not to be afraid, assuring her that the ringers couldn't keep up with the speed of his AE-86. He commanded his AE-86 to charge and run. Misunderstanding, Xu Hua told Yan Li that the people in front were trying to cover Cheng Dale's retreat. Yan Li responded with irritation, stating that Cheng Dale killed their king and now wanted to walk away. At the same time, Lu Ju informed Tong Fei that Cheng Dale was leading the rings to attack. Annoyed, Tong Fei ordered Lu Ju to prepare for the impending encounter with the enemy. The 3,000 troops of the rings and the 3,000 carp dragon guards clashed like two torrents. As they clashed, the dust from their horses added to the intensity of the battle. Tong Fei remarked that the situation was unfavorable, as Cheng Dale was escaping. She instructed Lu Ju to take some men with him to pursue Cheng Dale and ensure that he didn't get away. Lu Ju acknowledged her order. Also, Yan Li informed Xu Hua that they would hold back the enemy, and he ordered Xu Hua to take some men to kill Cheng Dale. Xu Hua confirmed his order. Xu Hua attempted to provoke Cheng Dale, asking why he didn't come and face him. Meanwhile, Lu Ju ordered his men to attack to catch Cheng Dale, as he wanted to break his legs. All of Xu Hua and Lu Ju's men were chasing Cheng Dale. When he glanced back, Cheng Dale told them to go about their own business, as there was no need for them to send a group to deal with him. Cheng Dale called the system and requested a little song. The system responded with irritation, informing Cheng Dale that she was not a street singer who would start singing at his command. Cheng Dale tried once more to request, asking the system to provide him with a battle song background music. Annoyed, the system responded that it was much better. Then it activated the war song, deducting 100,000 fear points, leaving Cheng Dale with only 201,151 fear points but increasing his racing speed by plus 50%. He realized that he ran out of fear points as he cursed. Suddenly, he noticed people in front of him, thinking that the people had appeared unexpectedly. The people in front of him wore smirks. One of them commented that Cheng Dale willingly came to them. Another one remarked that if they killed Cheng Dale, they would obtain Wanner and the book with the sword techniques. The third individual also chimed in, saying he heard about a great treasure hidden in the sword book. He told them that if they found it, they would become rich. Cheng Dale asked himself where those people came from. He told Wanner to hold on to him tightly as he would rush through in one breath. He swiftly attacked the people using his explosive fireworks techniques and sternly told them to get lost. Cheng Dale found himself surrounded by those people who signaled to each other to stop him. One of them demanded that he hand over Wanner and the sword book, promising to spare his life in return. Another one concurred with his comrade. 
Confused, Cheng Dalei wondered about the sword book they mentioned and questioned why he did not know such a book. Then, he complained to the system about the BGM being useless for fighting. He asked if she had a new song and requested to change the disc, to which the system confirmed. The system held the bullhorn, announcing that the war had begun and it was time to assemble, calling the group. And she blew it loudly. While Cheng Dale engaged in the battle, he couldn't help but wonder about the bullhorn and the type of BGM that was playing. He pondered that he didn't feel like it was strengthening him. As a group of galloping horses approached and searched for him, Cheng Dale swiftly glanced back to see those who were looking for him. Those people were Cheng Dale's group. They called out his name, informing him that all the men of Toad Village had assembled. Kin Man brought their flags and declared that they were there to help him. With determination, Liu Bei raised his sword as he commanded their men to charge. A year after the Battle of King New Mountain, the crowd grew stronger and the Gao brothers told Cheng Dalei that they all came. At a glance, dozens of top characters, the weakest in the army of 1,000 people, was also an excellent expert. Cheng Dalei raised his sword, greeted his men with joy, and mentioned that it had been a long time since they last met. He ordered his men to follow him in breaking the enemy formation, showing his face beaming with delight. His men attacked, following his command to break the enemy formation and ensure Cheng Dalei's escape. As they clashed in battle, the men who had once lived in exile were now reunited, their faces reflecting joy as they met again. The Toad Village brothers marched all the way. They were so strong that the country's people got easily scattered by them. Jiang Fei skillfully slashed the enemy using the Pierce the Pig technique, while they continued to break the enemy's formation. The county's people saw that the situation was not right and quietly began to retreat. Yan Li angrily ordered his men to kill Cheng Dalei, making it clear that they must not let him leave. Meanwhile, Luo Ju also gave his command to kill Cheng Dalei and emphasized that he should not be allowed to escape. During the war, Sai Long questioned the rarely joined forces between the Ring tribe and the Merlian guards. Wan Yu remarked that Cheng Dalei was already safe, and their task was to take care of the pursuers. He glanced at Sai Long and informed him that he would handle the Ring tribe on the left while Sai Long should take care of the Merlian guards on the right. Sai Long questioned Guan Yu about the strength of the enemy. Guan Yu proudly replied that he saw that the enemy was just selling their heads. As they battled, Guan Yu effortlessly sliced through the enemies with ease. Zai Long, on the other hand, used his technique and managed to knock down several opponents. Boastful, Gao Fei mentioned that killing rings still felt good to him. He looked back as Cheng Dalei called them, casually raising his sword and noting that the wind was blowing, signaling that they should go. His men acknowledged it and declared that they go. The Toad Village army formed a group, they used outwards and killed anyone on their way. The Merlian Guard and Ring Cavalry restrained each other, they were not able to catch up. All the people marched rapidly, and only a few people managed to reach the border. After escaping from the war, they regrouped, and one of his men asked where they should go next. Gao Fei suggested to Cheng Dalei that they could return to King New Mountain and gather their men together. Cheng Dalei replied that they needed to return to King New Mountain, but he did not intend to live there. He mentioned that Toad Village had just gone through a war, with only 10 rooms left and limited potential for the future. But he planned to take a few men with him and stated that there was something they had to do. He told them that after their business was done, they would all be going to the northwest, Kinchuan. All of them agreed that they would follow Cheng Dalei wherever he went, no matter what. Cheng Dalei gripped his sword and told his group that they should return to the village and pack up their belongings, as they would be bringing their families, men, and food. Lifting his sword, he instructed everyone to wait for him at Hulu Mountain, as they were already sent a hundred people there to join them on their journey to King New Mountain. Then, he raised his sword and declared that once he finished his business in King New Mountain, everyone in Toad Village would move to Kingchuan, and they would work together to rebuild their mountain village. As the night fell, Cheng Dale walked towards a tent. As the night fell, Cheng Dale walked towards Wanner's tent. He asked if she was asleep, to which Wanner responded that she was not yet asleep. She remarked that it was late and inquired about the purpose of his visit. Cheng Dalei informed her that they would be passing by the capital the next day and asked if she wanted him to send her back to Chang'an. Wanner was left speechless. Gazing into the distance, she asked herself why she would go back and questioned if she could continue being a carefree princess with peace of mind. Wanner expressed doubts about Emperor Ming's treatment, fearing it might not be the same as before. Cheng Dalei asked her about her plans, but Wanner only called his name. She told him that she wanted to go outside and see the world, much like Xing Zai, and mentioned that she used to think that as long as the Ring stopped invading the Empire, the people could live a good life, as she thought that the Ring tribe was evil, barbaric, and rude, but she had also met a friendly Ring tribe couple. 
On the contrary, the horse bandits of the empire and even Emperor Ming's Merlian guards were more ferocious and chilling to her heart. She questioned why the loyal Merlian guards had betrayed her and why the reputation of Lai's royal family was so bad, and asked why people around the world are looking forward to the turmoil, war, and longing for the destruction of the country. She expressed her confusion about why Xing Zai had chosen to wander outside, but now she was beginning to understand it and suggested that perhaps outside, she could see the real situation of the world's people, rather than being in a high position and blinded by false prosperity. Cheng Dalei asked if she had thought about the fact that the outside world might not be as comfortable as the capital, to which Wanner acknowledged it. He reassured Wanner to rest well that night as they would leave the next day. As someone hummed themselves to sleep, a sudden beeping sound notified, which stated that the third phase of the mission, Snatch the Mistress of the Fort, had been triggered. Cheng Dale wondered why he yet to choose that escort mission and instead took the mission to snatch the mistress of the fort. The notification mentioned that the second phase of the mission involved capturing Wanner, referred to as the Jewel of the Empire. Cheng Dale was dumbfounded by the mission he took and asked where the second phase of the mission came from. Wearing a playful expression, the system casually told him that she just did a little work on it, and she asked if he was happy with the surprise. But Cheng Dale just gave the system a bored look without saying anything. After entering the border, Cheng Dale left most of his men at Hulu Mountain and took hundreds of people to King Niu Mountain. During this time, something else happened within the empire. Wanner was taken away, and the peace talks between the two groups were torn up. The imperial court placed a large army at the border to guard against the invasion of the Ring tribe at any time. But apart from the harassment of some small tribes, the Ring did not invade on a large scale. One of the imperial guards reported, according to the imperial spy report, Hu Yanba died, the Ring tribe princes fought for the throne, and didn't have time to invade the empire for the time being. The news that Cheng Dale snatched Wanner reached the capital. The Merlian guards who were responsible for escorting the princes trembled, but did not expect that Emperor Ming only sighed three times and did not punish anyone. The imperial authority of the empire was long gone, the vassals moved, and various civil forces rose, peeping at the position of the world supreme. In the blink of an eye, January had already passed. Cheng Dale traveled a long distance, and King New Mountain was almost in sight. As they traveled to King New Mountain, one of Cheng Dale's men said to him that another 20 miles, and they would be able to reach King New Mountain. Cheng Dale remarked that after the war, there were no more people there, as the trees grew really fast, and he could not recognize the place. He asked Gao Fei if he remembered the way to the ruins of the old village, to which Gao Fei responded that it seemed like they needed to find a high place to figure out their way there. Cheng Dale confirmed and told them to stay in their place as he would go to a high place to have a look. Gao Fei affirmed his decision. He went to find a high point to survey the area. As he reached the high point, Cheng Dale pondered about his return to King Niu Mountain and how he had come for the treasure map. Back then, the mountain village had been flooded, making it impossible to dig for the treasure. He pondered as he looked at his map, thinking that he was poor and needed the treasure as startup capital to rise again. Hoping that no one had gotten there first, he suddenly realized that something was not right, wondering why there was not a single bird chirping. He thought that there was only one explanation for the situation. Amid his thinking, a rope suddenly appeared and was swiftly tied around him. He suddenly filled with fear as he saw what was happening before his eyes. A man who was hiding in the trees held the rope, descended, and pulled it over. Due to the shock, Cheng Dale let out a curse, and his horse was comically surprised as well. Cheng Dale found himself hanging in the tree, realizing it was an ambush, and the birds had already been scared away. It turned out that the two people were Xing Zai and Fu Dale. Xing Zai told Cheng Dale that he opened the mountain and planted the tree. He informed Cheng Dale that if he wanted to pass through, he needed to pay a toll. Cheng Dale expressed disbelief, feeling like Xing Zai got karma. Cheng Dale smiled awkwardly, asked Xing Zai if there was one more sentence he missed. Xing Zai questioned what was missing and Cheng Dale said that he would tell him in a second. Suddenly, he broke free from the rope and said that he didn't care about killing but hated burying. After freeing himself, he landed swiftly on the ground, surprising Xing Zai and Fu Dale. Surprise, Fu Dale commented on Cheng Dale's strength, while Xing Zai expressed his disbelief that Cheng Dale had managed to free himself. Angry, Cheng Dale clenched his fist as he insulted them, daring them not to move, asking if they could not recognize their ancestors in the industry. 
However, the two of them turned their backs on Cheng Dalei and started whispering to each other. In their conversation, Fu Dalei asked what they should do, remarking Cheng Dalei seemed to be a tough guy. Xing Zai responded that there was no need to be afraid, as Cheng Dalei was alone and just a little stronger, emphasizing that they had a sword. Fu Dalei suggested that they should go together so they could grab some food, mentioning that they hadn't eaten for days, which Xing Zai acknowledged. Xing Zai, still trying to act tough, insulted Cheng Dalei by calling him a kid and told him to consider it his bad luck. He rudely demanded Cheng Dalei to hand over his dry food, warning him that he shouldn't be blamed if he had poor eyesight with his sword. With malicious intent, Xing Zai continued to threaten Cheng Dalei by claiming that his sword was coated with poison, while Cheng Dalei simply stood unbothered. Suddenly, a rustling sound caught Cheng Dalei's attention. Then, all of his men arrived and asked Cheng Dalei what was wrong. Frightened, Xing Zai and Fu Dalei were taken aback when Cheng Dalei's men suddenly appeared. Both were quickly subdued by Cheng Dalei's men. Xing Zai pleaded with them to stop hitting his face as he cried in pain. Gao Fei told them to be honest. Wanner appeared, called Cheng Dalei, and asked what was going on. Xing Zai realized that he was Cheng Dalei, seeking confirmation if he was him. He asked Cheng Dalei if he recognized him, telling him his name was Xing Zai. Upon hearing it, Wanner sought to confirm if he was Xing Zai, expressing surprise. Cheng Dalei, pretending not to recognize him earlier, asked if he was Xing Zai. He questioned how the elegant young master from the past had become so low. Xing Zai awkwardly laughed and responded that it was a long story. He also expressed his surprise at how much Cheng Dalei had changed. Cheng Dalei ordered Kin Man to untie them as they were their people. Kin Man untied both Xing Zai and Fu Dalei. Curious, Wanner asked Xing Zai how he became like that, to which Xing Zai put his arms on Wanner's shoulders and said that it was his business and wasn't important. However, Xing Zai wondered why Wanner had become involved with Cheng Dalei even though she had returned to the capital. He asked Wanner if she was kidnapped by Cheng Dalei. Wanner expressed shyness in front of Xing Zai and told him that there was no kidnapping involved and confessed that she was the one who wanted to follow Cheng Dalei. Xing Zai stumbled in his words as he was taken aback by that moment. He did not know how many things he imagined in his head. With exasperation, Xing Zai asked Cheng Dalei what he did to Wanner. Cheng Dalei playfully responded to Xing Zai that many things happened that he couldn't tell him. Xing Zai asked again what Cheng Dalei meant by a lot of things and insisted that he be clear. But Cheng Dalei laughed in response. Wanner chimed in and told Xing Zai not to ask what he shouldn't ask, especially since he hadn't eaten enough. Xing Zai replied that he was very hungry and asked if they had anything to eat. He also requested some clothes, urging them to hurry up as they were hungry for days. A minute later, both Xing Zai and Fu Dalei ate bread and crunched it with satisfaction. Wanner told Xing Zai to eat slowly or he might choke. While Fu Dalei ate, Cheng Dalei complimented him about how he played the lasso well. He asked Fu Dalei if he was from the Ring tribe. Kin Man reacted and returned the question, but Xing Zai told them to take it easy. He introduced Fu Dalei as a friend and not a bad guy. Cheng Dalei commented that there are good and bad people among the Ring tribe and since Fu Dalei was a friend of Xing Zai, he welcomed Fu Dalei as one of them. But he contemplated that Fu Dalei knew about him and was afraid of him. Meanwhile, Wanner asked Xing Zai why he returned to King New Mountain again. In response, Xing Zai explained that he had nowhere else he could go, so he fled. He added that he was captured in the northwest and fled to Bingzhu after the war. From there, he escaped to Lianzhu and was caught digging in the black mines. They managed to escape to Qingzhu but were almost caught there. Confidently, Xing Zai explained that he thought about it and believed there were a few acquaintances in Yuzhu. He returned to try his luck but got lost in King New Mountain and almost starved to death. Cheng Dalei wondered why he didn't return to Chang'an, as everyone was looking for him there. Xing Zai responded that he also intended to explore outside and learn more about it. He emphasized that he wouldn't have a chance to go back to the capital. He asked Cheng Dalei what was going on with them and if they were still planning to rise again in King New Mountain. Cheng Dalei calmly replied that he came back this time just to retrieve something. King New Mountain was no longer suitable for development. Curious, Xing Zai asked why Wanner was with him, mentioning that he didn't feel comfortable with it. He reminded them that he and Fu Dalei had no place to stay and asked if they could follow him. In response, Cheng Dalei playfully asked if Xing Zai wanted to follow him as a bandit, to which Xing Zai clarified that he wanted to be their guide, not a bandit. After their conversation at King New Mountain Toad Village's former site, the group walked on top of the wall, and Cheng Dalei mentioned that it was a year and a half since they left, and so much had changed there that things were different. Fu Dalei looked at Cheng Dalei's map silently. He pondered that he saw the treasure map of his brother Kai Mei, although it was the same marked in King New Mountain.
However, the location was different from Cheng Dalei's map, and he suspected that there were two copies of the treasure map. While Fu Dalei was in his thoughts, Cheng Dalei pointed to an area and called everyone's attention to dig it up. Gao Fei was surprised and commented that when the mountain village was built, he had not found such a cave more than 10 meters underground. Cheng Dalei interjected and ordered them to open it up, asking a few strong men to pull the door open. After they opened it, Cheng Dalei ordered them to tie a mouse with a rope and throw it inside to see if there was any miasma. After a minute, the rat came out unharmed. Cheng Dalei asked them to prepare a torch again and told Kin Man to go with him to explore the way first. He instructed the others to stay up there, to which Kin Man and Gao Fei confirmed. As they descended with torches, after walking a few dozen steps again, suddenly saw the light, and the place they saw was filled with gold. The gold glittered in front of them, and they were taken by surprise. Cheng Dalei couldn't help but curse as he realized that the treasure looted by the Ring tribe 30 years ago was a big fortune. People worked together to count the treasure, loading it in batches and eventually filling more than 10 carts. One caution to be careful is the box is fragile. Another mentioned dozens of boxes of gold and silver, pearls, and agates, while another one reported having counted more than a hundred pieces of jade. They covered the treasure with thick straw and grain, disguising it as grain and straw merchants. It took several busy days to empty it. Before Cheng Dalei left, he took his men once more to pay their last respects to their men buried in King New Mountain. He gave them a last message that it would be the last time they would see each other, and they showed appreciation. After their visit, the carriage began to move, and Cheng Dalei instructed his men to go. As they traveled, Xing Zai inquired about where he was going to take his men next. In response, Cheng Dalei revealed that they were heading northwest towards the Rukin River. He mentioned that Emperor Ming had appointed him as the guardian of the Qin River Pass and suggested to Xing Zai that it would be ideal for him as they could legally obtain the territory for himself. Xing Zai was taken aback and advised Cheng Dalei not to go there. Cheng Dalei was surprised by Xing Zai's reaction, asking him why he didn't want him to go either and questioning him about what was in that area. Xing Zai explained that he and Fu Dalai were the ones who just escaped from there. He pointed to their pitiful appearance from their past and asked if Cheng Dalei didn't understand him. He advised Cheng Dalei that it was not a place to hang out, as it was too chaotic. Stubborn, Cheng Dalei responded that Xing Zai's appearance seemed to be experiences filled with fear. He urged Xing Zai to tell them more about what was happening in there. Xing Zai explained that Northwest Qin River stretched 800 miles and was the main line of defense in the Northwest. Outside Beijing was the grassland of the rings, so this road was the main road for the rings trade. Domestic silk, tea and iron supplied to the Ring tribe were worth 10,000 gold, and the furs, jade and horses of the Ring tribe were also rare commodities in the country. However, since the empire did not allow trade with the Rings, this trade route was banned. Cheng Dalei asked what was the danger in the Qin River Pass and if it was a treacherous environment there, but Xing Zai denied. He explained that the person who is now occupying the King River Pass is called Mo Ming, who was originally a mountain bandit but was later recruited and appointed as the deputy general. And because Kin River was in the highlands and the emperor was far away, he had at least 10,000 private soldiers which put the whole Kin River Pass under his control. Interjecting, Kin Man speculated if it could be a mountain bandit, which made Gao Fei react telling others that they should make it clear to them who was in charge. With a wide smile, Zhang Fei remarks that even if there were tens of thousands of them, there weren't too many, while Gao Hu comments that they would teach them how to behave and what to do, displaying aggression on his face. Incredulous, Xing Zai pondered about Cheng Dalei's men and wondered how he raised such a group. He emphasizes the fact that they were only a thousand men, while there were tens of thousands of men on the other side. He questions Cheng Dalei if he intended to teach them how to behave. Cheng Dalei explains that it is because Mo Mingmi controls the business channel to do business and questions why Mo Mingmi didn't want others to interfere. Xing Zai responds that there's more to it than that. He spells out that the main reason for the conflict is the discovery of iron ore in the area. Mo Mingmi was plundering people to mine it for himself and selling it to the rings at a great profit, and emphasizes that it was against imperial law, so he didn't want outsiders to get their hands on the place. He also shares the horrifying conditions in the mines, where civilians were mistreated, and many went in alive but came out as nothing but bones. The fear in Xing Zai's eyes was evident as he recalled the time when he and Fu Delay had been trapped in the mines and struggled to get out. Wanner questions how they dared to privately mine iron ore and sell it to the rings. She suggests that they should return to the capital and mobilize their troops to attack them. However, Xing Zai explains that things were not so simple as interests were intertwined. 
and says that he didn't have the troops to mobilize. His face became serious as he added that Mo Mingmi's capacities couldn't play on such a big scale, and also suspected that someone was behind it, but he didn't know who. Cheng Dalei realizes that Qi Yang had once sent someone to kill him, even if it was just to avenge Longting. He suspects that Qi Yang aimed to prevent him from reaching the Qin River, and he considers Qi Yang to be the one behind Mo Mingmi. Additionally, he believes that Emperor Ming had appointed him as the guardian of the Qin River passes as the monk indirectly hinted that he should head to the Qin River, and Cheng Dalei fears they wanted him to confront Qi Yang. He understands that the Carp Dragon Guards and the Imperial Army would not give him any trouble, allowing him to advance without fear. Contemplating a strategy to drive away and acknowledging Emperor Ming is good at what he does. Shortly after, Cheng Dalei and the others made their way back, occasionally encountering bandit vermin blocking the road. Some people even recognized Cheng Dalei. They all set out ceaselessly, buying food and other daily necessities in large quantities in all large and small towns along the way. Rumors in the business world became more and more exaggerated and became different versions. One person speculated that Cheng Dalei might have taken the treasure from the Book of Sword Techniques. Another claimed to have heard that Cheng Dalei employed certain techniques to make Wanner comfortable, explaining why she shared her hidden treasure. Similar gossip and speculations circulated within the group. From Hulu Mountain, Cheng Dalei was able to travel through a place called Liangzhu. After another month of running around, the crowd came to the northwest outside of the Qin River Pass. Gao Fei informed Cheng Dalei that Qin River Pass was just 20 miles ahead. Cheng Dalei responded, advising that they should not go to the Qin River Pass due to the insufficient number of troops. He emphasized that they could not let Mo Mingmi know that they were there. Instructing them to set up camp, Cheng Dalei planned to scout the mountains for a suitable location to build a future village. Curious about the requirements for the new village, Kin Man questioned Cheng Dalei, who confirmed the need for water, flat farmland, defensible terrain, and difficulty for attackers. Xing Zai interjected, expressing knowledge that he knew a place that should fit in the category. Surprise, Cheng Dalei inquired about the place. Confidently, Xing Zai mentioned that the location is easy to find but the only problem is that it is already occupied. Curious, Cheng Dalei asked who occupied the place. Xing Zai clarified that it wasn't people but snakes, emphasizing their poisonous nature. Despite this, all other conditions were met. Then Cheng Dalei ordered Kin Man to join him to see the place due to his proficiency as a hunter, to which Kin Man confirmed. Following this, Cheng Dalei instructed the rest of the group to temporarily dive into the mountains and forests to hide, which everyone confirmed. After an hour, they were able to get into Kin River Snake Island. Xing Zai proceeded to explain that Snake Island was a tributary of the Kin River, formed by the flow of the large river that created a pool, with the island in the middle called Snake Island. He added that the island was originally part of Mo Mingmi's water village but has been abandoned for reasons unknown and is no longer. Then Xing Zai mentioned that when Mo Mingmi left, he released numerous poisonous snakes on the island. Over the past 10 years, these snakes have multiplied and now occupy the island. Cheng Dalei asked him how they were going to get up there. Xing Zhe pointed to the path and told them that about 5 miles offshore there was a spot from which they could take a boat. He also asked if Cheng Dalei's men finished building the boat, as they went there by boat. Within a day, the men of the village built a boat. Xing Zhe began paddling towards Snake Island. A minute later, he announced their arrival, signaling that they could now go ashore and look. As they approached, hissing snakes greeted them. Xing Zai cautioned them to be careful, emphasizing the presence of snakes on the shore and the potentially life-threatening consequences of getting bitten. Cheng Dalei, quick to action, tightly gripped his swords and inquired whether the snakes were fearful of people. Without hesitation, he swiftly slaughtered them, causing some to flee away. Impressed, Xing Zai commented on Cheng Dalei's improved swordsmanship over the two years they hadn't seen each other. He boasted about his sword, claiming it to be one of the best in the empire. Cheng Dalei modestly responded that it wasn't bad, diverting the conversation. He called upon Kin Man, asking if he could identify the snake species, to which Kin Man replied that there were too many to recognize, but most were poisonous and highly toxic. The three walked around the edge of the island, roughly scouting the terrain but not going any deeper. Xing Zai mentioned that the island's center appeared to be Mo Mingmi's village, now covered in mist. Cheng Dalei advised that they didn't need to rush and suggested they look at it in more detail next time. Only when the sun set in the west did the three of them return. Kin Man, intrigued by Mo Mingmi's choice to keep many poisonous snakes, wondered if there was a meaning behind it that he couldn't figure out. Cheng Dalei, in response, it was a simple trap. 
He explained that Mo Ming the occupied places he no longer needed with poisonous snakes to create problems for the next one. As evening approached, Shen Ji inquired about the island's situation. Cheng Dalei described Snake Island as surrounded by water on all sides, easily defensible, and hard to attack. The island's flat made it good for planting, presenting an ideal place to set up camp. However, he emphasized the significant number of snakes on the island. Cheng Dalei emphasized that the key was to kill the snakes, and he directed Kin Man to take a group of men with him to split up in the surrounding towns for places that sold ruby sulfur. He instructed Kin Man to purchase a few tons of it first, to which Kin Man agreed. Worried about the potential danger, Shenji urgently called Cheng Dalei's attention, and he suddenly remembered one thing that they couldn't live on the island. Curious, Cheng Dalei asked why they couldn't live, to which Shenji explained that they were the Toad Village and that Cheng Dalei is known as the Toad King. Snakes are the natural enemies of toads. Cheng Dalei inquired if they would be putting themselves in danger by going to Snake Island. With a smirk, Cheng Dalei humorously remarked that if anyone else had proposed the idea, he might have needed some time to think about it. Flashing a broad smile, he gave a thumbs up to Shenji, expressing confidence that since Shenji suggested it, Snake Island might not be a place of great evil but could indeed be a place of great happiness. Concerned for Cheng Dalei's well-being, Shenji advised him to think twice and not be impulsive. Unbothered, Cheng Dalei simply assured Shenji that he knew what he was doing and even mentioned the possibility of changing his name. If needed, he joked about consulting a Taoist priest to recalculate everything, ensuring Shenji's to be calm. Suddenly, a beep sounded in the system, triggering another side mission conquering Snake Island and driving away the snakes. The system expressed its disdain for slippery snakes, instructing Cheng Dalei to expel every last one of them. As Wanner peacefully slept on Cheng Dalei's shoulder, softly murmuring his name, Xing Zai couldn't help but cast a cautious glance at her, while Wanner continued to call Cheng Dalei's name in her dreams. Feeling a bit awkward, Xing Zai remarked that it was his first time seeing Wanner display such an expression and wondered if Cheng Dalei had been through a lot. He recalled an incident from two years ago when Wanner and he traveled together, with officials along the way taking care of her until she could no longer make the journey, prompting her return to Chang'an. Xing Zai noted that now, she had chosen to follow Cheng Dalei to a faraway place, and commented that she was not as childish as before. Curious about Xing Zai's experiences over the past two years, Cheng Dalei inquired about him. Xing Zai explained that after sending Wanner back to Chang'an, he felt a sudden desire to go outside to look. He went to the grasslands from King New Mountain, herded sheep, worked with labor, and conducted business with merchants. Cheng Dalei took a glance at Xing Zai and asked about his feelings, to which Xing Zai admitted that it was terrible. He elaborated on the comfortable life in Chang'an with maids waiting on him. He still wanted to go outside to see the world, and recounted the invasion of the Ring tribe, the Empire's defeat, and how the realization of his royal status prompted him to question how he could remain indifferent and not strive to turn the tide against the current. With a sense of sorrow, he mentioned that the outcome was that no one cared about him at all, leading to his arrest as a liar, and making him appear foolish. In response, Cheng Dalei suggested that he had heard in Chang'an about his escape from prison, proposing that if he were sent back to Chang'an, he should be fine. Xing Zai, however, expressed reluctance at the idea of being sent back feeling somewhat embarrassed, especially given his status as at least the sixth prince. He didn't want to lose face in such a manner. Reflecting on his experiences, Xing Zai shared a story of running and fleeing with refugees, witnessing defeated soldiers and people. Despite the fear of the Ring tribe, the defeated soldiers, having lost their will to fight, but the ones that were the cruelest to the refugees. In the face of the Ring tribe, the defeated soldiers lacked courage but, disturbingly, they brandished their swords at the civilians. This realization led him to question that something was wrong with the Empire rather than blaming it on the Ring tribe. Throughout the year, Xing Zai continued his travels and observations and went to various places. He saw farmers and laborers work all day, alongside nobles bullying common people. But he questioned the issue with the empire, a question he had found. Seeking Cheng Dalei's perspective on the problem, Xing Zai asked for his thoughts. Cheng Dalei found it tough to respond to Xing Zai's question, unsure if delving into concepts like the economic base determining the superstructure and the inherent contradiction between vested interests and the lower class. Instead, he thought that maybe Xing Zai wouldn't understand, and he would need to explain it another way. Simplifying his explanation, Cheng Dalei likened the empire to a broken, rotten, and shabby house to collapse with a strong wind. 
He emphasized the changing dynasties, something that no one could change. In response, Xing Zai questioned whether a broken house couldn't be repaired. He suggested mending where it leaked, addressing the birth of termites to repel insects and new pillars. However, Cheng Dale stated that the most important thing was the foundation of the house. He explained that the load-bearing walls had been eroded by external weather aging, while internal termites had caved out countless holes. With a compromised foundation, Cheng Dale concluded that attempting to mend it was useless. Cheng Dale further explained that the country had lost the support of its people, making it difficult to survive. Even if the house were to be repaired, as long as the termites remained, the house would scrape down sooner as time passed by. He concluded that it would be easier to burn it down and rebuild it. After a word, Xing Zai sat in front of the bonfire all night, his face revealing deep sadness. He sighed heavily. A few days later, the brothers who went out to gather news gradually returned. One of Cheng Dale's men reported that there were five cities near the Qingchuan border, with the closest city called Heijia City. However, in the surrounding villages and small towns, there wasn't much realgar available for purchase. A large amount of realgar was required to get rid of the snakes, and they might have to gather it in Heijia City. Cheng Dale instructed his men to first send his people to buy all available realgar in small towns and villages. Regarding Heijia City, he expressed a desire to go there personally. Concerned about Cheng Dale's wanted posters displayed in major cities, his men suggested sending others to make the purchase. Cheng Dale found himself unable to formulate a response and considered the possibility that if he sent others to purchase Realger with a substantial amount of money, their appearance as country bumpkins might raise suspicions. Frustrated by their lack of business experience, they were easy to be fooled by. He yearned for the presence of Xiao Ying in handling such matters. He looked at Xing Zai without saying anything. Eventually, he called Xing Zai, wearing a big smirk on his face, indicating that he had an idea but needed to rely on Xing Zai's good looks. Curious, Xing Zai asked what he would rely on him for. Feeling anxious, Xing Zai hesitated for a moment, stated that he was there to study and didn't want to be dragged as a duck. Puzzled, Xing Zai asked what Cheng Dale meant by not a duck, although he accepted it. He swiftly withdrew, especially being a mountain bandit. At Heijia City, Cheng Dale insisted that Xing Zai and Fu Dele take a bath, expressing concern about their experiences and cheekily remarking on their rotten smell from head to toe. Once inside a tailor's shop, Cheng Dale suggested changing their clothes. A tailor complimented Xing Zai's handsome appearance, bowing in respect. Xing Zai almost called Cheng Dale's name but quickly switched to his disguised name, asking for clarification on what he wanted him to do. Cheng Dale explained that being the person in the wanted poster, it was better for him not to show his face. However, he was unsure about entrusting such a large shopping list to his men. Cheng Dale notes Xing Zai's appearance as a noble by nature and generosity wouldn't raise suspicion. As they strolled along Heijia Street, Cheng Dale mentioned inquiring about the largest herbal medicine shop called Xinglin Hall. Upon arriving there, Cheng Dale immediately instructed Xing Zai to purchase the realgar. Inside the shop, a commotion unfolded. A customer questioned the price increase of a packet of herbs, now costing 50 coppers instead of the previous 10. The shopkeeper responded with aggression, attributing the price hike to increased costs elsewhere. The customer pleaded for his mercy. Desperately, the customer knelt, explaining that his son had been ill for three months and needed medicine to save his life. In a heartless response, the shopkeeper dismissed the man's plea, telling him that his place is not a charity hall and told him that the door is open to do business, insisting to pay if he has money and get out if he doesn't have cash. Miserable, the customer accuses the shopkeeper of robbing him of his money. Cheng Dale thought about how a shopkeeper of an herbal medicine shop acts like that. He views his information, and realizes that the shopkeeper seems to be just an ordinary businessman. The shopkeeper notices them and greets them respectfully. He asks them if they are there to buy medicine. Xing Zai did not hesitate and promptly informed the shopkeeper that he was there to discuss some business with his boss. However, the shopkeeper revealed that the owner wasn't present and he was in charge. Disappointed, Xing Zai mocked the shopkeeper, questioning if he had anything worthwhile to discuss with him. Cheng Dale intervened, noting that they were from Kinchuan border and wanted to buy a large quantity of realgar and insulting the shopkeeper's qualifications demanding to speak to the owner. The shopkeeper, wearing an awkward smile, explained that the owner, Zyman, was close to Madame Pan recently, making them hesitant to disturb them. He inquired about the quantity of realgar they wanted and expressed that talking to him was the same as talking to the owner. Irritated, Cheng Dale pondered the names the shopkeeper mentioned, Madame Pan and Zyman. He inquired with the shopkeeper about the owner's surname being Zyman, and the name being King. 
the shopkeeper confirmed, and he questioned if Cheng Dalei knew the owner. Cheng Dalei couldn't believe his thoughts that it was indeed Simon King. He questioned if Madame Pan Pan Jinlian was there, wondering if Wu Daling and Wu Song were present. Blankly, Cheng Dalei responded that he didn't know them and that he just thought of an acquaintance. He steered the conversation back to business matters, prompting the shopkeeper to invite them inside for a discussion, noting the many people outside. Both sides negotiated smoothly, and Cheng Dalei offered a high price for purchasing common realgar, as long as Zinglin Hall sent it to the Qingchuan Riverside when the business transaction was complete for both parties. The shopkeeper suggested paying a deposit first so that they could arrange for their men to work, and Zing Zai handed over his jade, asking if it was enough. The shopkeeper, wide-eyed at the sight of the valuable jade, assured them it was enough. Zing Zai conveyed their stay in Heijia City for a few days and requested the shopkeeper to prepare the goods promptly. Upon leaving Zinglin Hall, the shopkeeper assured them that the required goods would be ready within three days at most. However, the shopkeeper couldn't conceal his excitement as he pondered the rarity of jade in the northwest, speculating that Cheng Dalei and his group might be involved in foreign business. With a malicious smile, the shopkeeper saw a profitable opportunity as a fat sheep. Suddenly, someone called out a shopkeeper named Lin Si, questioning the lack of business inside the store and asking him why he was standing outside. The shopkeeper greeted the person, revealing that it was Zyman. He happily showed the jade to Zyman, reporting the arrival of a significant businessman from Lai on the Qingchuan border. He mentioned that Xing Zai wanted to buy a lot of realgar, and the jade was their deposit. Zyman was surprised by the genuine value of the jade pendant, and accepted it as a deposit. Recognizing that Xing Zai originated from a rich family, Zyman expressed unfamiliarity with such a person from the Qingchuan border. With a sly smirk, the shopkeeper informed Zyman of his appointment with them to meet at the pier in three days. His eyes gleamed with cunning as he suggested plans for when they got on the boat. Zyman also wore malicious intent, agreeing to send someone to Qingchuan to check their background. If they turned out to be a mob, Zyman stated that they would not be spared, especially with Mo Mingmi backing up Qingchuan. Simon suggested robbing them regardless of Zing Zai's origin. The shopkeeper agreed. Three days later at the pier, the shopkeeper greeted Cheng Dalei, announcing that the goods were prepared, and the final payment would be settled after the delivery reached its destination. He instructed his men to take the goods on board, signaling their departure. The shopkeeper introduced Zyman to them and mentioned that Zyman expressed his intention to personally lead people to help escort the ship delivery. Zing Zai told them that they just needed to bring a few people to collect the final payment and did not need to bother with the escort, which Zyman declined. He insisted that since Zing Zai bought a huge number of goods, he would have to personally deliver the goods. While Cheng Dalei contemplated the odd behavior of Zyman, who refused the delivery and wondered why they still wanted to help, he realized that there was something fishy. He decided to view their information. As he viewed their information, he was genuinely surprised and realized that it was indeed Simon King and Madame Pan. It appeared that the pirate who washed up on the shore and Mo Mingmi took control of several nearby cities. Cheng Dalei commented on his thoughts, noting what an incompatibility this situation was. Cheng Dalei expressed gratitude and said that he would trouble them to escort him. He encouraged them to get on board the boat. As the ship sailed, Cheng Dalei engaged in planning with his group, assigning roles. Liu Bei praised Cheng Dalei as a wise man, and Xing Zai added his thoughts to the discussion. Outside the ship's cabin, a person speculated about what happened inside, questioning why they were hiding in the cabin. While others thought Cheng Dalei called for a meeting, someone added that the time had come as the ship reached the halfway point and suggested that they should prepare. Meanwhile, Zyman inquired about the readiness of the kitchen with the shopkeeper, who confirmed that the ingredients were prepared. Zyman instructed the shopkeeper to notify Cheng Dalei to join them for a meal. The shopkeeper opened the door, interrupting Cheng Dalei's group discussion. Unaware of their plans, he questioned what they were doing. As they continued discussing, Cheng Dalei whispered to his group that he didn't want to be called master. He changed the subject and called Zing Zai, telling him that he could change his name later. However, he still referred to Zing Zai as Wu Liji and Fu Delay as Wu Shuren. He turned around and explained to the shopkeeper that they were just discussing technical details. The shopkeeper told them that they had two more hours to reach Kinchuan and that everyone was hungry, inviting Cheng Dalei to join them for a meal. Cheng Dalei accepted the invitation. Curious about the waterway journey, Cheng Dalei asked the shopkeeper if he wasn't afraid of encountering robbers along the way. The shopkeeper was taken aback by Cheng Dalei's question, wondering if Cheng Dalei suspected their true identities. He awkwardly laughed and assured Cheng Dalei that there were no pirates in the area. 
With Mo Mingmi's arrival in Kinchuan, mountain bandits and pirates had disappeared, reducing any concerns for the guests. Cheng Dalei pressed further, asking what the shopkeeper would do if they encountered bandits. The shopkeeper responded that there was no if. Maintaining a mysterious tone, Cheng Dalei asked if they were bandits, which made the shopkeeper sweat and responded that there was no chance. He asked the shopkeeper again if they were the bandits. The group's Cheng Dalei wore devilish smiles, leaving the shopkeeper stupidly shocked. Suddenly, a bomb exploded inside the cabin, causing panic among those outside. The shopkeeper was thrown away. Unable to withstand the impact, he fainted, with someone calling out the shopkeeper's name and others inquiring about what happened. Simon questioned who the assailant was and dared to harm their people. Cheng Dale declared they were robbers, naming themselves the Alibaba 40 Arch Bandits, initiating their robbery. He instructed them to stand on the left, women on the right, and individuals identifying as gay or lesbian in the middle. Simon protested, asserting that they were doing business, and demanded an explanation from Cheng Dale regarding their current actions. With a touch of humor, Cheng Dale insisted that they were engaged in robbery. He playfully introduced his group as Alibaba's 40 Arch Bandits and referred to himself as Aliapa. Cheng Dale swiftly apologized to Zyman for his earlier words. However, Zyman dismissed him as a naive boy, questioning the audacity of his actions in touching his goods. He emphasized that someone was behind them and instructed his men to attack. Amid the chaos, Zing Zai nervously inquired if the robbery already began, admitting it was his first time. Disbelief, Fu Delay aggressively replied that he robbed before. Zing Zai spoke up, stating that it was only his second time, and asked if he couldn't be a little nervous. Fu Delay angrily retorted, listing instances of Zing Zai's past mischievous acts, including stealing chickens, cheating people for lambs in the grassland, and swindling children's candy. Zing Zai, nonchalant, agreed, admitting to their current state of robbery. After the chaotic event, in a desperate plea, Zyman questioned why Cheng Dalei targeted them, emphasizing they had no grudge against him. Cheng Dalei chuckled, acknowledging Zyman's statement, and called Liu Bei to give a report. Liu Bei informed Cheng Dalei that the ships and dry rations were drugged. Zyman begged for mercy, admitting their wrongdoing and acknowledging their failure to see the vastness of the world. He pleaded with Cheng Dalei, hoping for generosity and proposing they take the goods without the final payment. Wearing a satisfied smile, Cheng Dale expressed that he merely wanted to do business, not expecting Zyman to play mind games, deeming it wishful thinking. He pointed out that if Zyman thought he was easy to bully just because he was an uncle, he was mistaken. Cheng Dale gave two choices. He asked them if they preferred eating wantons or instant noodles. When Zyman inquired about the meanings, Cheng Dale insinuated that he was uneducated. He slowly unsheathed his sword. Cheng Dale clarified that wanton meant tying them up and throwing them into the river, while instant noodles meant killing them and feeding their bodies to the fish. Simon was visibly terrified as he heard this ominous explanation. Cheng Dale told them to make a choice. One person chose wanton, and Cheng Dale's men promptly threw him into the sea, creating a splash. The shopkeeper and others also chose wanton and instantly jumped into the ocean, creating splashes in the ocean. The tied men tried to swim. Cheng Dale commented on their fast decision. Turning his attention to Zyman and Madame Pan, trembling in fear, Cheng Dale informed them it was their turn to choose within 10 breaths. He begins to count starting at 10. In tears due to fear, Zyman pleaded for mercy, asking Cheng Dale to treat him like a fart. Madame Pan, expressing her inability to swim, added to the distress. In the background, Cheng Dale continued to count down, reaching 9 and 8. Cheng Dale threatened Zyman with the sword, stating that crying would count as time. With that, he declared that Zyman's time was up and decided he chose instant noodles. But Cheng Dale swiftly pulled him back, causing Zyman to scream in terror. Zyman looked back at Cheng Dale and asked if he wanted to kill him. With a mischievous smile, Cheng Dale replied that he wouldn't kill him. He realized that robbing in the waterway for a long time, understanding that jumping into the river could not drown Zyman, he informed Zyman that he changed his mind and would have to think of another way for people like him. Zyman's face showed extreme distress. Cheng Dale called Zing Zai to lock Zyman up. One of Cheng Dale's men reported that their men on the island were ready, and once the real girl arrived, they would begin to move. Cheng Dale ordered to keep going. The ship was docked on a nearby rock. Why Zing Zai asked Cheng Dale how he knew they were pirates, to which Cheng Dale replied that robbers could see through their own kind, and that a mountain bandit, and pirates attracting each other were normal. Lai Zinzai inquired why he let those pirates go back and report, and he wondered if it was truly alright because he remembered him saying that Simon King was Mo Mingmi's underling. 
and Cheng Dale told him that the news must have spread whether they moved or not. Cheng Dale predicted that Mo Mingni would get to know about the arrival of a new force in Kinchuan sooner or later. He went on to say that they were 40 arch bandits, at least to confuse them for a period of time, and that they would most likely send small troops to investigate because they thought of them as a small group of foreign bandits. Cheng Dale told Lai Zinzai that he was correct, and that the situation would be completely different if they knew he was Cheng Dale, to which Lai Zinzai replied that there was no need for him to call his alias there, and that he always thought he was suggesting something by giving him names. Cheng Dale laughed at him and told him he was imagining things, and one of his subordinates informed him that the Realger had been completely unloaded and they were ready to start, to which Cheng Dale replied that they would act in groups and be fast. Cheng Dale told his men that they had to establish the first line of defense of the mountain village and stand firmly as quickly as possible. Everybody tied the rice straws into clumps and wrapped them with Realger and lit them up. Smoke from Realger was used to disperse the poisonous snakes in the grass. A group of snakes were trapped due to the smoke. After dispersing, the Realger was scattered into the soil to prevent the snakes from coming back and it took them a day to drive out the snakes separately and clear out a large area. Finally, Cheng Dale led his people in the heart of Snake Island. A voice informed them that Mo Mingni's abandoned mountain village was right in front of them, and he wondered why they abandoned it given the good terrain. Another voice chimed in and asked what was going on, and a man asked Kin Man if it was due to the forest's miasma, to which Kin Man replied that it was just an ordinary fog. Cheng Dale suspected something was in the fog and informed his people that the sun was scorching outside and that it was strange that the fog was not dispersing. He warned them to be cautious because something was wrong, and there must be a demonic beast nearby because they couldn't see a snake. As they encountered a skeleton, Cheng Dale wondered what it was. He was perplexed because a snake bite would leave a whole body as it was. Cheng Dale told his men that they were going to look inside the gathering hall, but Zhu Shenji warned him to be careful because he suspected there was something strange going around. Cheng Dale ignored him and opened the door. He stepped one foot inside, and a big silhouette appeared in front of his eyes. The green-eyed snake stared at him. Distressed, Cheng Dale let out a curse word. Cheng Dale backed away. Puzzled, as a huge white snake greeted them, Kin Man wondered how such a huge snake could exist in the world and claimed that the fog nearby was caused by it, whereas Zhu Shenji suspected it was a dragon. The snake hissed and expelled smoke through its nose, and a voice announced that it was about to turn into a dragon because it was swallowing clouds and spitting fog. Zhu Shenji trembled and prayed to the snake that after being forced by the government to become homeless, he and his brothers had no choice but to become bandits. The crowd worshipped three times, declaring that in the future they would rob the rich to help the poor, and that their rights and wrongs would be in accordance with heaven's decree, and they wished for the snake to forgive them. However, the snake hissed and released more smoke. It swiftly charged at them. It opened its mouth as if it was about to eat them. Cheng Dale grabbed Zhu Shenji and told him to watch out as the snake collided on the ground. He ordered his men to retreat. Cheng Dale yelled at them to run and stated that the snake was not something they could deal with. The snake came outside the gathering hall, while Cheng Dale's men ran and yelled at their brothers to run. The snake hissed once again and inhaled the fog. It retreated back inside the gathering hall. The snake hissed once more. For some reason, the snake king stopped chasing after them away. He coiled up inside the house again. They gathered outside the gathering hall, and someone asked how everyone was doing and if anyone was hurt. Liu Bei informed Cheng Dale that no one was killed, with the exception of a few brothers whose legs were crushed by the snake, and Cheng Dale expressed relief and praised them. He imagined the island's beast territory filled with poisonous snakes, and he wondered how such a large snake could be raised, where it came from, and what it ate to live. He pondered how such a massive snake could be born in the world, especially if it contradicted the theory of evolution and quickly realized that he was looking at the wrong scene because it was not the supernatural hunting world. Zhu Shenji wondered if they really had to give up the island after going to such great lengths. Cheng Dale asked him when he said they were giving up and told him that they couldn't charge the snake recklessly, that they needed to outwit it, and that there was no reason to let their brothers fight with that huge snake. He told them he needed a lot of meat and wine and that they should go first and bring Officer Zaiman to him, to which they agreed. Cheng Dale stared at his sword and said nothing. He claimed that it was hard to use common swords on such a huge, thick-skinned snake, and the size difference was so great that he wondered if he needed to give it acupuncture. He also ordered his men to bring his ghost face axe. Moments later, a voice asked someone if they wanted to live. Cheng Dale told them that he would give them a chance if they could show him that they could get a lot of meat and wine. 
King Zaiman informed him that he had a brewery shop in Heijia City and if he were let go back, he would bring the wine tomorrow. Cheng Dale asked him if he was stupid or the other way around and if he would still be willing to come back if he let him. He suggested that he write a letter to his people to send the wine, and that if he saw the meat and wine, he would let him live. He informed him that he wanted 50 jars of strong wine, 10 pigs, 10 cows, chicken, and ducks. King Zyman told him to ask someone to send his letter to Wu, because she would be the only one willing to save him. Cheng Dale told Zhao Zilong that he and Kin Man would go and try to bring the wine and meet early that morning, to which Zhao Zilong agreed. He asked King Zyman who Sister Wu was, and he replied that she was his wife. Cheng Dale told him that his time was short, and if the ransom for him didn't arrive tomorrow, he asked him not to blame him for being merciless. If the soldiers and bandits ended up fighting, whether he lived or died would depend on his relationship with his wife. Cheng Dale stated that he could only wish him luck and asked him to do the same. The next morning, Zhu Shenji noticed an approaching ship and informed Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale wondered what it was and if they were loaded with soldiers or ransoms, and Su Shenji squinted his eyes observing the boat. He claimed that he saw a tall man on the boat, which Cheng Dale inquired about, and Zhu Shenji suspected that they reported it to the officials. Zhu Shenji ordered his brothers to prepare for battle as the enemy's ship approached, whereas Cheng Dale threatened King Zaiman with instant noodles. When a voice asked where King Zaiman was, Cheng Dale was perplexed. Wu Daling of the Lun family introduced herself as King Zaiman's wife. Cheng Dale questioned whether the woman was really called Wu Daling, and was surprised that the Wu Daling of this world was tall and female. He thought it was a coincidence that King Zaiman and Wu Da Lang got together, claiming that their circle was extremely messy, while Wu Da Lang begged him to let King Zaiman live. An information appeared stating Wu Da Lang's name, 38 years old, and nothing else. Cheng Dale asked if she had brought him what he asked for, to which she replied that the meat and wine he wanted were on the ship, and she asked him to let King Zaiman live. Cheng Dale directed his men to release King Zaiman and unload the goods, and Wu Daling informed him that the wine and meat she brought were only for her husband, and Madame Pan had nothing to do with her. She said she would leave her to them, and they could either fry or boil her. He told her to cut the crap and get out, and that if she was slow, she could stay forever, to which she quickly agreed. Wu Daling scolded King Zaiman, cursing him and telling him that his company would do no good, while Madame Pan asked King Zaiman to wait for her, and Su Shenji stated that King Zaiman had a really good wife. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale if he was going to use the wine to burn the Snake King to death, to which he answered that he wanted to make it drunk. Because it's just a snake, Zhu Shenji wondered if it could drink, and Cheng Dale told him that if it couldn't drink, it would eat meat. Cheng Dale stated that he didn't believe the snake could grow so big on just a meal of wind and water. The men carried the meat. They laid it in front of the gathering hall. Pork and cows were in line as the fog began to cover them. Because it was good wine and a good meal, Cheng Dale prayed for the snake king to come out and eat. Kin Man informed him that it was almost an hour, but the snake king seemed uninterested. And Cheng Dale assured him not to worry and asked if their brothers were ready for an ambush. He told him to let them prepare because their success or failure was at stake, and Kin Man informed him that the explosives were also ready. Kin Man asked where he got so many explosives, and Cheng Dale told him to think of it as a gift from the gods to kill the giant white snake. Cheng Dale noticed something and pondered. He told them to be quiet because something was moving. A green eye peeked through the gathering hall door, and the head of the giant snake came out. Kin Man excitedly informed them that it came out. The wine and meat were delicious, and Cheng Dale wished the Snake King would eat quickly. The snake hissed as it approached its food. It devoured one from its platter. Kin Man hoped for the snake to eat it, but Cheng Dale told him to be quiet because it needed to be quieter, baiting snakes. As the snake gulped its food, the group hoped for it to eat it up. A voice asked Cheng Dale if the wine was not strong enough because it didn't seem to be drunk, to which Cheng Dale responded that the one meat of at least a thousand pounds of wine inside was such a large amount. He assured Kin Man not to worry. The snake wobbled, to where they believed that it got drunk. Then moments later, the snake passed out. As it fell, it made a rumble on the ground. Kin Man informed Cheng Dale that it was now drunk due to the fact that it was down. Cheng Dale told his men to go forward and listen to his command. He directed them to get the explosives and light it up. The men threw explosives at it and blew it up. As Cheng Dale and Kin Man watched, a massive amount of explosives exploded at the snake. Cheng Dale continued to observe the explosion and said nothing. He wondered if it worked. Cheng Dale's eyes grew wide open. He realized it had been awoken and informed his men. As the snake charged at them at full speed, a voice warned them to watch out. Kin Man and others yelled Cheng Dale's name. 
Cheng Dale informed them that the snake had become enraged and ordered them to step aside. Cheng Dale wondered where the snake had grown up because it deserved to be a demonic beast of heaven and earth. He called for heart and told her to possess him. Cheng Dale kicked the snake, and he was almost eaten alive as he fell. Cheng Dale released his colorless double wing phoenix skill. He believed that it was now a good chance. Cheng Dale pierced the snake using the straightforward sword tooth picking. His sword failed to pierce the snake's tough scales. Cheng Dale was unamazed that he couldn't even break its abdomen without scales. The snake hissed loudly as it began to counter Cheng Dale. Tin Man directed his brothers to take out their swords and cut the snake. Cheng Dale told them to step back because the snake was too fast and powerful. He went on to say that having so many people was useless and instructed them not to come up and die. He also warned them that he would attract the snake's attention and that they should leave the yard. Worried, Kin Man asked Zhu Shenji what they should do because they could not watch Cheng Dale fighting the snake alone desperately. Whereas Zhu Shenji mumbled that he should hurry up and think of a way. And not after a while, he already gets an idea. Zhu Shenji instructed his brothers to use the Rilger and quickly threw it to the snake, to which they agreed. Cheng Dale continued to fight the snake. The men threw the Rilger powder wrapped in paper simultaneously and hoped for it to hit the target for them. The Rilger exploded and surrounded the snake with toxic smoke, which made Cheng Dale surprised. Cheng Dale inquired as to whose idea it was, as he didn't need their help and it was now dusty, and he couldn't see anything. One Rilger exploded at Cheng Dale's back. Enraged, he demanded to know whose aim was so bad that it hit his head. The group looked down because Zhu Shenji was the culprit. They told Cheng Dale to look out. The snake roared as it opened its mouth wide while charging towards Cheng Dale. The snake closed its mouth and made a loud noise. The men screamed that Cheng Dale was eaten, while others thought it stank and wondered how long it was since the snake brushed its teeth. The snake ignored them and proceeded to devour its meal. The snake's eye grew wide, and its mouth slowly opened, and a shadow appeared beneath it. Cheng Dale inquired if it wanted to eat him and warned it to be careful not to explode its teeth. Cheng Dale let out a vice of struggle as he used his strength to lift the snake's mouth. Then suddenly the snake sucked the air around the area. Fog began to enter the snake's mouth. Cheng Dale cursed as he was slowly being pushed away. He yelled that since the outside couldn't be cut, he'd try the inside and see how hard its mouth was. He asked Hart to exchange 10 boxes of gunpowder, and when Hart informed him that his fear points were now 100, he agreed to give her some spice. Hart quickly summoned the boxes of gunpowder. She snapped her fingers, which lit up the boxes, and told him to go ahead. Cheng Dale inquired of the snake whether it liked to suck because he could suck all the gunpowder. The gunpowder exploded inside the snake's stomach. The snake's mouth and body began to spew fire and smoke as the explosion continued. Dao Fei Hu and the others were taken aback, wondering how Cheng Dale had explosives on him when none were willing to intervene in this kind of battle. Both continued to fight as the snake began to spit blood from its mouth, accompanied by fire. Cheng Dale fell, and also the snake breathed its last. Both of them fell, and blood was seen around the snake's body. Cheng Dale began to cough, vomiting blood. Heart dispersed her possession. The snake hissed once more. The snake's scales began to heal at a fast rate. Cheng Dale's eyes widened as he wondered if its wound was healing fast and wondered what the hell the monster was. He asked Hart to exchange another 10 boxes because he didn't believe explosives could kill it, and Hart responded, asking him to wait. Hart noticed that the snake seemed to have similar power to hers, so she informed Cheng Dale. A notification appears, stating that the detected container had residual power, and Cheng Dale questions Hart who responds that the snake may have a container with a lot of power. She told him she needed to talk to the snake to figure out where it got its power, and if it was dangerous to leave the system's power out there. Cheng Dale asked her how she wanted to talk with a snake. Hart told him that she had to talk with it face to face. Hart processed the external power retrieval system and requested permission to intervene in reality. Cheng Dale was informed that it was a rare opportunity for her. A notification appeared, stating that dimensional travel permission was granted. The administrator informed that Hart would travel through the dimension to reach the present world. A system warning appeared, indicating that the administrator's presence in the present world might be observed by irrelevant existence without permission. Moments later, time froze. The men became still beings. A voice chuckled and mentioned that it could finally come out and play for a while. It likened the experience to traveling from the upper atmosphere to underwater. Hart used to appear in the form of the main character's embodiment. The barrier separating the two worlds was broken. The body approached the snake. A voice addressed the snake, causing its eyes to widen. 
As a result, a notification appeared, stating that it was now reclaiming system power. Hart descended from system space to the present world in her own body for the first time. Hart asked the snake where it got its power from, like a young girl who had met her family. The snake told Hart that it was the first time it met her kind due to her body scent, and Hart retorted that she was not a snake, it was just that its power was originally hers. She asked the snake to give it back when it was enough. The snake said it couldn't understand nonsense and asked for a favor, promising to pay her back. Hart reasoned that she needed to use her mental power to talk to it directly because it stuttered when speaking, and it seemed that no one in the world could teach him after the opening and its consciousness was close to a childish guy. So she inquired if it wanted her to help. The snake said that its master was sleeping, and it needed him to wake up. Hart, perplexed, questioned the snake about its master while following the white snake's gaze. She needed to go straight to the broken house behind. The house was empty except for a skeleton, so Hart asked the snake if it wanted her to wake her up. Hart doubted and inquired of the snake that it was a skeleton. The snake insisted on waking her up. Hart informed the snake that she couldn't wake her up because the skeleton had no soul, and she couldn't see anything. She told the snake she was dead, and the snake wondered what that meant. Hart inquired if it didn't understand. Hart explained to the snake that death was like not waking up, that she couldn't open her eyes or talk to him, and that death meant she was no longer in the world, to which the snake replied that it didn't understand. And according to Hart, the withering of plants was death. She went on to say that insects and animals turning to dust were also dead. Hart explained that its master went to the world of the dead, and those who were there couldn't come back. She apologized and told the snake there was nothing she could do. The white snake remained silent for a long time, standing still as if dead. Hart mentioned that the snake's master died here and that she thought she might have left something behind. She asked the snake if it could let her see its memories because she might be able to help her. She also stated that she needed to know how it got its power. Hart asked the snake if it could recall the moment it first opened its eyes and uncovered the dusty memory. She claimed that she would be able to see its past and its memories. The white snake began its life in a hot, moist rainforest. A small village next to the rainforest was home to its owner, who seemed to make a living by raising snakes and insects. But the village's appearance in its mind was always a vague picture. It only remembers breaking its shell in the hands of its master who had warm hands. It followed its master since birth and spent several years in such an ignorant manner. Not until it swallowed a sword somewhere in a tomb. The sword melted into its body like water and slowly changed something. And soon, some changes began to occur in its ignorant brain, and it became a wild beast among snakes. And for the first time, it saw the world with its spiritual intelligent perspective, and it could observe some things more clearly but couldn't recognize the essence of things. After that, a lot of things seemed to happen in the village, and it didn't understand the villager's words, but only knew that the master's daughter was a girl with silver pupils who disappeared. The snake master left the village in search of her kidnapped daughter, and only stupid snakes left, accompanying themselves. The snake felt lonely, and it wanted to go find its master, and it left the village, avoiding the towns and went through the mountains and forests. The wilderness was dangerous, and it was painful being beaten by beasts, but even if the snake was injured, it just needed to sleep. Perhaps as long as it was large enough, nothing could stop its way. The snake thought so, and the power deep in its body responded, so it grew bigger. It wanted to find its master and followed the vague guidance of its heart. The snake came to the snake island. It believed that its master should be here, and those people with spears were yelling and running around. The snake found it annoying. The snake asked where its master was. Angered, it asked again where she was. The snake caused chaos on the island, and finally, in a dungeon, it found its master sleeping. The snake felt that its master's body was cold and the snake was actually only a few years old, with an intelligence of a three-year-old at most. It couldn't even understand what the concept of death was. The snake broke through the metal bars as it believed that its master had just fallen asleep, or so it thought. And even if it was beaten several times, it just slept and was able to recover like before. The snake stated that the thing it could do, its master must be able to do too, and to let her sleep, she needed to find a place that could keep out the rain. The snake found a place encircling its master and wished her a good night's sleep. But occasionally, an annoying guy comes running to the door. The snake chased the men, telling them to get out because they're a nuisance. It believed that its master was hibernating, and hibernating was a long time to sleep. The snake claimed that it was now time for a quieter environment. It went on to say that it was as quiet as the mist that didn't lift around the village. And just like that, as soon as its master awoke from her sleep, she could go back by herself. 
a white snake with a childish worldview was guarding its master's bones for 10 years. Hart stated that she saw the snake's master and informed him that she came to find her daughter. She also stated that she didn't know if he could understand, but her master's descendants were the continuation of her life, and maybe she could help him find her daughter. She went on to say that the owner of the island murdered his master 10 years ago. Hart advised him that avenging her was also a good way of consoling his master's spirit in heaven. An orb glowed inside the snake's stomach. Grumbling, the orb began its ascent, and a golden sword came out of the snake's mouth. The snake stuttered, asking Hart for a favor as he returned the sword's power to her. Hart realized that the sword was the vessel inside the white snake. Hart grabbed the orb, and suddenly became a physical sword. Hart claimed that it was her first time seeing the power retained and well intact. She felt that the power was closely related to her life. The sword was called the Red Sky Sword, and it was one of the ten famous swords and had a saying to cut the white snake, lift the three-foot sword, and create an unparalleled achievement. Hart told the snake that he should keep some of it for himself but was cut off in the middle of her explanation when the snake replied that he no longer needed it, and that she could have it. Hart absorbed the sword. She asked the snake if he could tell her what he wanted her to do, and she would do her best. The snake responded that before he left, he wanted to see his master one more time. Hart asked what he meant and where he was going. The snake asked Hart for her help. He stated that she could look through his memories and maybe she could help him. He stated that he hadn't seen his master in a long time and had forgotten what she looked like, so he asked Hart to give him a dream in which he could see her. The snake hissed as Hart placed her hand and told him to sleep. She assured the snake that if the rest of the world forgot about him, she would be the one to remember. She asked the snake to sleep, and the long wait was finally over, a long nap, where he could wait until she woke up. When the snake opened his eyes, he was surrounded by the sultry rainforest and familiar villages, and everything he saw was familiar, as if the long wait was just a long dream. The snake stated that the village people and the silly snakes were still the same, and the person the snake had always dreamed about at night, the face that had been blurred, suddenly became clear. The woman asked the snake where he had been. The snake wrapped the woman where they were both having a good time. The snake scales began to vanish, as Hart told him to sleep, and the snake slowly faded in the air. Hart detached her hand and said nothing. She sighed at the sight of the snake. Dejected, Hart stated that it was all for the sake of seeing his master and that he could now go to that world to find her. She assured the snake that he could go and stop worrying because she would finish their agreement. Meanwhile, outside the house, time was still frozen. Cheng Dalei stood like a statue. He claimed that he couldn't move because it was so hard. Hart approached him and informed him that it was now done. She told him the snake was a good boy and that snakes were now cute for her, whereas Cheng Dalei mumbled nothing. Hart wondered. She snapped her fingers and apologized as she forgot that time and space were still frozen. She released time and space freeze restrictions from the host's body as Cheng Dalei struggled to breathe, to which Hart replied that they both blew up the white snake belly with gunpowder, and he should tell the snake that they were a team. Hart went on to say that it was just simply to settle him down. Unlike others, he could know what happened by connecting to her mind. She informed him that the snake had left him a surprise before leaving. He told Cheng Dalei to look up. A huge amount of golden light shone above, as Hart stated that it shattered itself, and its body's power was all scattered out. She went on to say that the vessel had been returned to her and that it could live for hundreds of years with its own body, which had become a demon. Hart told him that she did not expect it to be so decisive, and thanks to the snake's blessing, the place would become a paradise. She informed him that she had also obtained the vessel and had a new idea, to which Cheng Dalei inquired what it was. She stated that he now must get the approval of the vessel first, otherwise, he couldn't use its power. A system notification popped up stating that he received the vessel's exclusive mission, the White Snake's Will. Hart told him to hurry and get the Red Sky Sword approved so that the new function based on that vessel could be used soon. Hart informed Cheng Dalei that the power of the White Snake was expected to be fully released in three days, and during that time, she warned him not to let others touch the White Snake's body because ordinary people couldn't stand close to the power it emitted. She stated that she could only stay for a short period of time and told Cheng Dalei that the rest was up to him, instructing him to properly dispose of the snake's body. Hart stated that she would leave now because she had a lot of work to finish. She also warned him not to tell the others about the white snake because those things were not for them to know. Hart told him she was leaving now and let the hourglass flow. The men were perplexed as to why there was so much smoke as they couldn't see anything. Tian Man and the others asked Cheng Dalei if he was alright and where the snake was. They asked why the snake disappeared so suddenly. Cheng Dalei informed them that the snake had returned to the house and that it should be dead, and that he needed a few people to accompany him into the house and deal with the aftermath. 
a man asked Zhu Shenji if he should go in and look instead, and he replied that he was old and it was hard for him to go upstairs, and it would be much better for them to go with Cheng Dale to look. Cheng Dale scolded them to cut the crap and come. Kin Man noticed that the snake was not moving and wondered if it was sleeping or if it was truly dead, whereas Gao Fi who questioned whether the snake died in this manner. Cheng Dale approached the snake. He had the impression that the power of the snake's body was dissipating. Zhu Shenji warned Cheng Dale to be careful and not let the snake eat him if it pretended to be dead. Cheng Dale claimed that his men couldn't even see it while he was looking for information. He described the white snake as a legendary rank, a higher level than supreme rank, and that since it was his first time seeing a legendary rank, it was no surprise that it was so powerful. A description of the white snake, originally known as Whitey, appeared and was ranked legendary. Cheng Dale thought its abilities were beyond the beast realm and had already reached the demon realm. After more than two years, he had not yet figured out the world's power system, but it was definitely not as simple as it seemed. He believed that others couldn't see the power emanating from the white snake's body. He also claimed that the system could summon storms and give birth to such a snake under the influence of system power, and that the world held many secrets waiting to be uncovered. Zhu Shenji asked what they were going to do with the snake body because he heard that snake meat is a tonic and an aphrodisiac. Cheng Dale inquired if he dared to eat it, and Zhu Shenji questioned him, cheerfully explaining that he heard of a dozen ways to eat snake meat. He suggested steamed, braised soy sauce water, stir-fried snake, stewed snake pot, and snake soup. Cheng Dale informed him that there would be no eating, which made him wonder. Annoyed, Cheng Dale once again told him not to eat it and that was his final order. He addressed Kin Man and Gao Fei Hu, telling them that they should take a few people outside the house to guard the giant snake, and that no one was allowed to touch the snake, especially Zhu Shenji, and that he should be watched carefully, and not to let him steal and eat it. He also asked them to notify him if there were any irregularities, and they agreed. Cheng Dale addressed his other brothers, telling them that now that the White Snake King was slain, they should continue to drive the snakes away and build their village. It took another 10 days, and the Toad Village people finally drove most of the snakes to the shallows. The man murmured that the fog in the mountain disappeared. They believed that it seemed that the White Snake King was really dead. Another man yelled to look over there, wondering what it was, while others wondered what was going on. They yelled that there were so many birds wondering if they were coming back to build a nest, while others believed it was due to the snakes being chased away. Cheng Dale wondered if it was because of the influence of the White Snake King. A man appeared and informed Cheng Dale that something had happened to the White Snake King. He went on to say that that morning they went to have a look, and there were only white bones left in the body of the White Snake. Dao Fei who inquired about what he said and wondered if it was a beast or a demon. Cheng Dale believed that it might be that the snake's power had dissipated. He ordered Zhu Shenji to take someone to bury the white snake king's bones, which made Zhu Shenji wonder. He informed them that there was a female skeleton next to the white snake and instructed them to take off the bracelet from the skeleton and bury it with the white snake, as well as to erect monuments to them. A system notification appeared, stating that the territory obtained Snake Island as well as a deathbed gift from the white snake king. Another notification appeared, stating that the side mission to occupy the Snake Island and drive the snakes away was completed, with the reward being a territorial blessing buff. Hart also stated that she added another buff to his new territory. She raised her hand and mumbled that she opened that place. She flicked his finger, and a massive glowing orb appeared in the middle of town, while Hart claimed to have planted the tree. She went on to say that the place was covered by that spirit. A notification appeared with the title Territorial Shelter Buff. Hart mumbled that Cheng Dale was filled with motivation, and from there, he would start and build the strongest village again, and throw himself into the flood of chaos and leave his legend in the world. Another notification popped up stating the mission to build a mountain village was received, and another mission stated to complete 10 robberies was received. A voice instructed them to clean up the debris and bury the pots and pans to make a meal. They were also told to clear the weeds and trees from the street, while others informed them that the abandoned houses only needed to be repaired and could be inhabited, while others warned everyone to keep an eye out for passing wagons and to be cautious because there were still snakes hiding in the nooks and crannies. A man spoke up and said that they have money, but the village was just built and the supplies were not enough, so they would have to live with hardships for a few days. He told his men not to be sloppy because that was where they would live. Another commanded to cut down the trees outside and build the village wall. 
a system notification appeared stating that the first level village is completed, and the reward is a chance to win a lottery. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man to put up the flag, and Kin Man said yes. Another notification popped stating that the population of the village reached 1,000, and he would receive a second level village construction drawing. A system information appeared, describing the Toad Village as an abandoned basic village owned by Cheng Dale, with a population of 2,513 people. Another notification was announced as the second stage of the task to rob a wife for the village is completed, and he successfully brought the princess to the village. And seconds later, a treasure map reward was obtained, and Hart chuckled and told Cheng Dale that she drew it with her own hands. Cheng Dale told Gao Fei Bao to take the list and drive to a nearby town to buy supplies, and that he has to buy as much food, cloth, iron pots, bedding, and other necessities as they needed, and warned him not to be observed and reveal his identity, and Gao Fei Bao agreed. He also stated that important supplies such as food should be placed in the hands of capable people such as himself, and Gao Fei Bao responded that he understood and that even if he has to sacrifice his life, he would bring back the food. Then later on, Cheng Dale watched the ship as it departed. Worried, Cheng Dale wondered if it wouldn't be a problem. He took something out from his shirt. Apart from building the village, he was thinking about something else as he grabbed a piece of paper. He reasoned that he should also take advantage of the opportunity to locate the treasure on the treasure map that the system rewarded. When he looked at the treasure map, he assumed it was on Snake Island. He thought that it was located in the village, and he just didn't know which builder it was under. Suddenly, Zhu Shenji came rushing, addressing Cheng Dale to come. Cheng Dale inquired why he panicked and needed to remain calm during major events. Zhu Shenji informed him to take a look because someone found something extraordinary. He went on to say that they found a place when they cleaned up snake bones. Zhu Shenji believed it might be the dungeon Mo Mingni built. He also told Cheng Dale that the sheer size of the dungeon was mind-blowing. He went on to say that he didn't know how many people were locked up in the first place, and also stated that the most important place was not here and asked Cheng Dale to follow him. He took Cheng Dale to the deepest part of the dungeon, which made Cheng Dale harden his face, because in front of them were piles of bones. Zhu Shenji informed him that they were all human bones, of any age and from different places, but their identities were more or less the same, and they were all civilians, and he is also afraid that it was a sin caused by Mo Mingni's human trafficking. Cheng Dale paused and said nothing. He ordered Zhu Shenji to clear out the bodies and bury them on the island, and let them also be buried in the earth, and Zhu Shenji agreed. Cheng Dale also told him to tell their men to keep an eye out for a list of their human trafficking because he could use it, and Zhu Shenji agreed. He stopped and wondered, whereas Zhu Shenji asked him what it was. Cheng Dale assumed it to be the location of the treasure drawn on the treasure map. A voice asked Zhu Shenji to get a couple of guys to dig at cell number 3 because something was buried there. A group of men rummaged around inside the cell. A man informed Cheng Dale that he found the entrance to a hole in the ground. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dale if it was another gift from the gods, and he replied that it wasn't like he didn't already know, as he learned all his skills from the gods. Tin Man ordered them to go down quickly and check it out. Zhu Shenji was the first one who came down bringing with him a lamp. He opened a wooden door. A large amount of gold welcomed him as he informed Cheng Dale that they were rich as they got two treasures in just a few months. Meanwhile, in the Kinchuan River, specifically, the Kinchuan Mountain Mine, a voice yelled that the amount of iron ore dug was not enough and ordered them to hurry up and keep digging. Another voice retorted that it was clearly more than yesterday's amount, and the man responded that yesterday's amount was the minimum. Another man yelled that from that day, that is the minimum standard that they must meet and that if they did not finish digging, they would not be able to eat. He whipped up a worker and told him to get up and not to play dead. He wondered if the man was really dead and ordered that he be thrown out, as well as scolding the others for being such lazybones. At the mine peak, a man addressed his lord. He reported that dozens had died in the mine last night, and now there was obviously not enough manpower, and went on to say that at that rate, he was afraid that the amount of iron ore mine could not satisfy the appetite of the ring tribe. The man who was called Lord stated that the flocks of two-legged sheep could not die in any way, and when they die, they go to the village and catch some more. The Kinchuan Mountain Deputy General, Mo Mingmi, told him not to bother him with such simple matters, as he was told many times before. The man understood and informed Mo Mingmi that he would arrange someone to catch more but paused as he was about to address his concern. Mo Mingmi looked haggard, so the man asked if he hadn't slept well the night before. Mo Mingmi responded that a scout reported last night that many suspicious people were found near Snake Island, 
and Simon King of Heiagia City was also robbed of a boatload of Realgar. Mo Mingmi assumed that the purpose of those people was the Snake Island, whereas the man stated that the Snake Island was guarded by the Snake King, and they also released so many poisonous snakes on the island. The man questioned whether they could still deal with the Snake King even if those people could get to the island using Realgar and he claimed that so many people couldn't do anything because the Snake King was not afraid of Realgar. Mo Mingmi was worried about what was buried on Snake Island being dug up. He told the man that he still needed to send someone to look at it because he always felt worried, and the man agreed. Later, a group of carriages marched down a small road outside of Heiagia City. Dao Fei Bao expressed his exhaustion and stated that the next time he must ask Cheng Dale to get a few more horses to transport the goods, whereas his companions asked him if he wanted to take a rest first if he was too tired. Gao Fei Bao responded that there was no need to rest, and that their brothers were still waiting for their food and clothes, claiming that they did not need to waste time and hurry up. His companion offered him some wine to refresh himself. Gao Fei Bao stated that Cheng Dale told them not to drink and drive, and that if a driver was drunk, the relatives sitting in the back would suffer. And his companion replied that Cheng Dale sometimes said strange words that were hard to understand. Cheng Dale, according to Gao Fei Bao, was indeed knowledgeable. He told his companion that Cheng Dale told him that only capable people, such as them, should go buy food, and he laughed. He also stated that they had to step up because they could not let Cheng Dale be disappointed, and they agreed. As his companion noticed and informed Gao Fei Bao, a large group of people appeared in front of them. Another man asked what they should do because he thought they weren't good people, and Gao Fei Bao replied that they'd see what they wanted first. Because they were pulling so much food and clothing, a man in front of them asked if they were new there and if they were merchants. The men of Yun Zhonglong were asked if they had never heard of their leader, Yun Zhonglong, because they were doing business without paying respect. Gao Fei Bao told them that they were new, and they just came to buy some food for their boss. However, the man claimed that there was a group of bandits recently known as Alibaba 40 arch bandits in the vicinity, and that his boss was one of them. Gao Fei Bao told him that he must be mistaken because they didn't know who Alibaba was. But the man retorted that Gao Fei Bao was ugly, stubborn, and had a bandit look, and that he could tell he was a bandit at first glance, and ordered his men to tie them up. Gao Fei Bao begged to spare them because they didn't know, and he believed that they couldn't lose to them because the brothers he brought out with him were all elite. He also believed they were surrounded by several times their number, but the man told him that it was not up to him to decide whether they were mistaken or not. Instead, he ordered them to come if they were smart, and ordered his men to tie them up and bring them back to Yun Zhonglong for a nice interrogation. Annoyed, Gao Fei Bao believed that they would be wrapped like dumplings and addressed his brothers. He unsheathed his sword. As Gao Fei Bao leaped, he told his brothers to do it. Gao Fei Bao cut one of the soldiers. The man yelled at him for daring to cut one of them and assumed they were the 40 arch bandits, while the other soldiers yelled to kill them all. Gao Fei Bao ordered his brothers to abandon the food wagon and grab the horses without mounts because they broke out. He ordered them to break to the right flank as they charged with their horses. They continued to charge as they trampled on the soldiers. Gao Fei Bao yelled that they broke through and told his men not to fight and move out. He told them to go into the woods, whereas the soldiers yelled to chase them. The men continued to restore the house. A voice yelled, addressing Cheng Dale. He informed him that the food and clothing purchased by their brothers were robbed, prompting him to question the man. The man informed him that the Toad Village had always been the one bullying, and that no one could bully them, but their brothers were being bullied and were aggrieved. Confused, Cheng Dale asked the man what exactly happened, and the man informed him that they bought several carts of food and clothes from Heiagia City, but on their way back, they met someone who claimed to be Yun Zhonglong. Moments later, the man resumed his report, concluding with such and such. Cheng Dale asked if he meant that they killed seven or eight people on their side, and the man agreed, and asked if they got away, and the man agreed again. He also inquired if they stole a dozen horses from the other side, and the man agreed. Cheng Dale praised the man and told him another question. He asked the man what exactly he was complaining about, and the man who was sobbing stated that the food they bought had been robbed, and they couldn't let people bully them like that. Cheng Dale told the man to send some brothers to find out the origin of Yun Zhonglong so he could bring them to justice, and the man thanked him and said he had to find out. Gao Fei Bao informed Cheng Dale about Yun Zhonglong, who was one of Mo Mingmi's men and one of eight lieutenants, and was the closest mountain bandit there. He also heard that at this time, they wanted to find Alibaba, 40 Arch Bandit, 
and that would be a problem for them, which irritated Cheng Dale as he stated that it's Mo Mingmi's people again and wondered how powerful Yun Zhonglong was. Gao Feibao reported to Cheng Dale that he had discovered his lair, and that there were only three or four hundred people inside. He asked if they should send their brothers to destroy them at night. Cheng Dale told him not to hurry because they had not suffered any losses, that their target was them and that sooner or later they would come to their door. Exposing themselves would be too early and would cause trouble, and their top priority was to finish the village first. He ordered Gao Feibao to continue to go out and buy food and avoid them as much as possible, and Gao Feibao asked him when they would be going to fight Yun Zhonglong. Cheng Dale told him not to hurry and that he should go and buy food first, which made Gao Feibao sigh and depressed. Cheng Dale later realized that the big snake destroyed most of the original building, which was built 10 years before and that it was beyond repair. He thought that it was simple to tear down and rebuild, and directly upgraded it to the level 2 mountain village. He assumed that even though the point summoning platform was opened early, it could only be used after upgrading it to mountain village level, and the summon top talent had to do a mission to listen, and he disliked using the point summoning platform. Cheng Dale thought that the people summoned were really real flesh and blood of people, and not just data, and it always felt weird to use it. He realized that this time he could not just hold on like what they did on King Yu Mountain and fight the Ring Tribe, and the ultimate goal this time was to defeat the King Chuan Guard, and he also believed that as long as he could open up the point summon platform, he would be able to fight Mo Mingmi, and while he was thinking this, a man called him. Gao Feibao informed him that the food was bought and asked when they would defeat Yun Zhonglong. However, Cheng Dale advised him not to rush and to simply wait because there was still so much to do which made Gao Feibao depressed. He also mentioned that the island's original yards needed to be repaired and that another bridge would be built from the island's shore. But Gao Feibao was still upset. Gao Feibao followed Cheng Dale asking him if he wanted to do it that day because he had sharpened his sword, and Cheng Dale wondered what to do because they should cut down trees. After a while, Gao Feibao called for Cheng Dale but was ignored because he was busy. Gao Feibao continued his persuasion but Cheng Dale told him they're doing it next time because he had no time. As the day passed by, Gao Feibao's spirit was suppressed in the bottom of his heart. He didn't have an appetite every day, and he also couldn't sleep at night. Liu Bei asked Cheng Dale if Gao Feibao was okay and if he wanted him to give him psychological counseling and Cheng Dale replied that he should just leave him alone. Liu Bei wondered if Gao Feibao wouldn't fall ill easily, and Cheng Dale said nothing. A man later asked his younger brother why he still looked so down when he was out fishing. Gao Feibao informed Gao Feihu that he was also a person, and that he was also the second leader of the Flying Tiger Village back on King Niu Mountain, and that he was always the only one who bullied people, and no one could bully him. He stated that Cheng Dale also stated that he was a capable person and specifically assigned him a task. The results of the food and clothes were robbed halfway, and Cheng Dale also refused to stand up for him, claiming that he must be disappointed in him. Gao Fei who believes that he was simply thinking too much and that Cheng Dale was too busy and couldn't find spare time. Irritated, Gao Fei Bao asked him how people should have looked at him, if they could still have fun together in the future, and how he could swallow his anger in his heart. He had a thought in his head that if Cheng Dale couldn't do it, he would. He walked out, thinking that the more he thought about it, the angrier he became, and the further he stepped back, the more he lost. Gao Fei who asked him where he was going. He also thought that no matter what, he must find a powerful helper to go with him. And now Gao Fei Bao was a dumbfounded young man that acted rashly. Birds flew through the sky. As waves smashed against the rocks, Zhao Zilong meditated in a secluded spot near the sea. He closed his eyes as he concentrated. A man arrived, carrying a bottle addressed to Zhao Zilong and informed him that he had come to see him for a drink. Gao Hu approached Zilong, expressing concern and noting that Zilong seemed tired all day. He inquired about what Zilong did. Concentrating, Zilong still replied that he watched the sea and listened to the waves, refining the meaning of the spear of the sea waves. Intrigued, Gao Hu asked if it worked, and Zilong confirmed that it worked, though acknowledging that it worked for him. Gao Hu interpreted this as an implication of his lack of talent, assuming it wouldn't work for him. Zilong turned to him and asked what he wanted. Gao Hu smiled awkwardly, expressing his desire to have a drink with him. He considered Zilong to be the most capable person around and admitted that he felt a bit upset. Understanding the sentiment, Zilong asked if Gao Hu shared it with Cheng Dale. Hesitated, Gao Hu responded that he thought Cheng Dale didn't seem to care. Zilong apologized, explaining he wouldn't take any unnecessary actions without orders from Liu Bei and Cheng Dale. 
He politely asked Gao Hu to leave if there was nothing else as he needed to continue practicing his spear techniques. Gao Hu was left speechless. After that, Gao Hu reflected on the situation, thinking that he couldn't tell Gao Fei about it, fearing he would inform Cheng Dalei. He also considered other options besides Xilong, mentioning that there were still Kin Man and Guan Yu. However, he excluded Guan Yu due to his arrogance and that there were few people he highly thought of. While walking, he spotted Kin Man exercising. Gao Hu pondered on Kin Man's cautious nature and surely thought that he wouldn't take risks himself and sighed heavily. Soon after, Gao Hu went to look for another capable person, but the villagers he approached did not agree to his requests. Finally, without exception, he hit the wall and sighed in despair. Gao Hu's spirits lifted when he heard the rhythmic sound of a cutting board. He observed Zhang Fei's mastery skills as he sliced the fish. In that moment, inspiration struck back. Gao Hu applauded Zhang Fei, complimenting his excellent knife skills. Zhang Fei greeted Gao Hu and asked if he had witnessed his excellent knife skills. Gao Hu began flatteringly praising Zhang Fei that in their village, Cheng Dalei was considered the expert in speed sword techniques. However, he acknowledged that when it came to accuracy, Zhang Fei deserved to be recognized as the best in their community. Zhang Fei smiled and questioned who had declared him the number one in the village. Gao Hu responded that everyone in the village spoke highly of his skills and asked if Zhang Fei was unaware of it. Flattered, Zhang Fei chuckled and humbly stated that he preferred to keep low-key and expressed his discomfort with such praise, emphasizing that he didn't enjoy hearing those at all. Despite his initial reluctance to accept compliments, Zhang Fei was intrigued and urged Gao Hu to share more. Gao Hu, seizing the opportunity, mentioned that he happened to have some wine with him and suggested they talk over a drink. In response, Zhang Fei also invited him to taste his cooking. Afterward, the two cooked the sliced fish. Zhang Fei was proud of his sliced fish and warmly urged Gao Hu to take the seven slices and fry them first. The two enjoyed lively conversation, where Gao Hu chuckled, while Zhang Fei agreed, expressing that he felt the same way. The two chatted until sunset and ended up getting drunk. As the cups toppled over, Zhang Fei shared with Gao Hu that chatting with him had cleared his mind. Drunk, Zhang Fei noticed that Gao Hu's mind was still not clear enough about something. He reassured him, expressing readiness to listen if Gao Hu needed him and he should feel free to ask, emphasizing that he doesn't need to be polite. Gao Hu shared that the recent incident weighing on his mind was the food shipment robbery arranged by Zhang Long's men causing him to suffer such pent-up frustration. Expressed disappointment with Cheng Dalei seemed not to care. In response, Zhang Fei reassured Gao Hu not to worry, asserting that he would take care of it. Zhang Fei confidently declared that it wasn't just Zhonglong and that they could do it, suggesting that that night they planned to meet Zhonglong to help Gao Hu to appease his anger. In his thoughts, Gao Hu realized that his plan had succeeded. Gao Hu asked Zhang Fei what if Cheng Dalei would find out. Zhang Fei reassured him that it was okay, mentioning that they would go and come back secretly, ensuring that Cheng Dalei wouldn't find out. Gao Hu asked if it was just the two of them and suggested that they shouldn't find more men. Zhang Fei responded by saying that with just the two of them, they could get the job done, as there weren't many people. He confidently declared that with his snake spear, he wasn't afraid of a thousand powerful armies. Drunk, Gao Hu asked if they must go. His laughter was barely contained. Zhang Fei confidently affirmed that they must go. They exchanged a fist bump, agreeing with each other and expressing their determination to do it. As night fell, Gao Hu approached the guards watching over the boat, expressing gratitude for their hard work. One guard questioned Zhang Fei and Gao Hu, asking where they were headed so late. Other guards warned them to be cautious, mentioning that all the snakes on the island had been driven to the shallows. Gao Hu responded, explaining that they had drunk some wine and decided to go ashore for some fresh air. Both of them walked gallantly, exuding great vigor. He instructed the two guards to prepare two horses for them and send them ashore, and the guards confirmed their understanding and readiness. At night in Dragon Village, a man inquired about the progress of the investigation. The general reported that a dozen or so highly skilled people, adept at killing and stealing horses swiftly, were likely the Alibaba gang. Infuriated, the man told him that the general was attacked by a dozen people but failed to capture any of them. He questioned if they only robbed a dozen wagons of grain and asked where they had fled off. The general replied that they finally saw them hiding on Snake Island, but their men did not dare to go up there because the Snake King was there. He advised the man not to be annoyed. He theorized that the thieves might be passing through and unaware of the existence of the Snake King and even speculated that they might have already been eaten by the Snake King. In response, the man introduced Zhonglong, decided that they ignore them in the meantime, and informed the general that Mo Mingni instructed them to investigate Cheng Dalei, and he asked if they found out anything. 
The general reported that the only new force that came to Kin River recently was the Alibaba gang, and no other strange faces arrived. Acknowledging the report, Zhonglong stated that they could step back. He emphasized that if they heard anything from Cheng Dale, they should report to him first. The general confirmed it. After their conversation, Zhonglong sighed heavily, lost in his thoughts about when Cheng Dale would arrive. Contemplating the idea, Zhonglong considered that even if Cheng Dale were more ruthless than Mo Mingmi, he could change the situation. Otherwise, in a few years, when the rings had accumulated enough iron ore, no one would be able to withstand the might of the heavily armed rings army. A quarter past midnight outside Dragon Village, Gao Hu informed Zhang Fei that they had arrived. He mentioned that it was the village where Zhonglong went after stealing grain from him. Zhang Fei commented on the size of the village, inquiring about the number of people inside. Determined, Gao Hu informed him that it wasn't large, with only four or five hundred minions. He suggested that they should go in and put a stop to it all at once. Suddenly, a wind passed them. The cold breeze woke Zhang Fei up for the most part. He found himself wondering where he was and who he was, contemplating his existence in that place. Fear crept into his expression at the possibility of confronting four or five hundred people all at once. Feeling uneasy, Gao Hu glanced at Zhang Fei and asked if he was scared. He suggested that if Zhang Fei was afraid, they could turn back. Gao Hu was worried that they would be seen as a joke by the villagers. Zhang Fei, triggered by Gao Hu's words, became determined and responded that he was not scared and asserted that he had never been afraid. He declared that it was time for them to show off, and they immediately charged toward the village and started shouting. They hastily charged to attack, while the guards were alerted and demanded to know who they were, questioning how they dared to intrude into Zhonglong territory. However, Zhang Fei and Gao Hu advanced and barged into the village. Inside, many soldiers blocked their path. Zhang Fei challenged them, questioning how they dared to block his way. He demanded to know the whereabouts of Zhonglong, threatening to kill anyone who stood in his way. The soldiers were sent flying as Zhang Fei used the catch-the-pig technique. Meanwhile, Zhonglong was in his room, engrossed in reading when a soldier barged in and reported that someone was attacking them. Surprised, Zhonglong inquired about the number of people on the opposing side. The soldier informed him that there were only two, and Zhonglong reacted in disbelief and questioned how anyone would dare to come and fight them with only two people. Zhonglong swiftly left his room, declaring they go and catch them. Amidst the chaos, Gao Hu inquired about the whereabouts of Zhonglong, stating that he was coming for him. He expressed his anger at how Zhonglong dared to rob him and threatened to chop him up. The two continued their advance and swiftly dealt with the soldiers, especially Zhang Fei who effortlessly defeated them using his catch-the-pig technique. Zhang Fei asked Gao Hu if he still had not found Zhonglong. He urged him to hurry and to kill him, emphasizing the need to get out of there. He remarked that the soldiers were wearing military gear, suggesting that the one behind the village might not be an ordinary person. Gao Hu responded that with so many people, it wasn't easy to find Zhonglong. Irritated, he noted that many of the soldiers had beards and questioned why they all had beards. Zhang Fei urged him not to hesitate any longer, stating that if they couldn't find Zhonglong, they would take their boss with them. As they were busy battling, Gao Hu spotted Zhonglong dressed in red, hiding behind a pile of soldiers. Zhang Fei questioned if that person was Zhonglong, and Gao Hu questioned. He suggested that they needed to catch Zhonglong, or they would be devoured by the pile of soldiers they pushed forward. While on the opposing side, the general instructed the soldiers to hold off Zhang Fei and Gao Hu and to surround them, emphasizing that there were only two of them. The soldiers quickly charged Zhang Fei and Gao Hu as they shouted to hold them off. However, Zhang Fei swiftly threw the soldier out of his way as he used his catch-the-pig technique. The soldiers were surprised and commented that they were unstoppable. Many soldiers growled in pain as they were knocked down by Zhang Fei and Gao Hu. Zhang Fei announced his name and readied his hands to capture Zhonglong. He declared for Zhonglong to come over, and Zhonglong's face showed visible fear as Zhang Fei's hand drew closer to him. Helpless, the soldiers were alarmed as they shouted to Zhonglong. They expressed their anxiety as they witnessed Zhonglong being caught. The general of the bear and the tiger were the first signs. Zhonglong resisted Zhang Fei's grip, insisting on letting him go. Irritated, Zhang Fei scolded him for being noisy. Zhonglong's face widened as he saw the fist coming and got punched. Zhang Fei told Gao Hu that they should leave, as more and more people were coming. The soldiers continued to call out to Zhonglong, who was now unconscious. The soldiers persisted in attacking and urging them to stop as they got Zhonglong. Many soldiers were injured, but some continued to surround them as they could not let them get away, while Gao Hu and Zhang Fei were making their escape. Determined, Zhang Fei called for Gao Hu to follow him and make a path. 
He cast, poke in the ground catch the pig technique, which made the soldiers fearful and forcefully threw them out of their way. Employing the blow of the poke the sky technique, the spear cut through the pile of soldiers, creating a bloody path as they stepped over corpses. The soldiers questioned if Zhang Fei was the fierce tiger, while others continued to instruct their fellow soldiers to guard the village gate to prevent them from escaping. As they blocked the entrance, they glanced back and wondered about the source of the noise, feeling as if someone might be behind them. Suddenly, the entrance gate exploded, catching the soldiers off guard and eliciting groans of pain from them. A group of Cheng Dalai's men managed to get inside and proceeded to attack, surprising the soldiers. They announced that their village gate had broken, and the enemies were pouring into the village. Cheng Dalai led his men in the attack, the anger evident on his face as he advanced. Lit up with joy, Zhang Fei questioned how Cheng Dalai had arrived. Gao Hu simply addressed Cheng Dalai. Annoyed, Cheng Dalei responded to cut their craps, and they get out first. He also informed them that he would settle the score with them later. Turning to his group, he informed everyone that they had them and instructed everyone to evacuate and hurry up, and urged everyone to go and repeatedly emphasize the need to retreat. After the incident in the gathering hall, Cheng Dalei scolded Zhang Fei and Gao Hu and pointed out that in the middle of the night, they ran off to kidnap someone else's village master. Cheng Dalei commented that the two of them were something and demanded to know who told them to do it, while the two showed frowning faces. He questioned them back to whose idea exactly it was. Liu Bei interrupted, advising Cheng Dalei to take it easy for now and reassuring him that they were fine. However, Cheng Dalei continued to scold them, criticizing them for being private, permissive, and disorganized. He asked what should be done according to the rules of their village. Shenji chimed in, questioning Cheng Dalei about the rules of their village and when he had set them, expressing that he didn't know. Liu Bei acknowledged that they didn't seem to have any rules, prompting Shenji to suggest that Cheng Dalei could set up rules now. In response, Cheng Dalei remained silent. He called Gao Hu and Zhang Fei, informing them that he punished both of them with a hundred deep squats, a hundred pull-ups, a hundred sit-ups every day, and a twenty-mile endurance run. He also declared that they wouldn't stop until they achieved six packs. Cheng Dalei also warned that if they stopped, he would shave their hair and mentioned that he knew it was Gao Hu's idea and added Gao Hu's punishment to cleaning the toilets. Both of them, wearing pensive faces, accepted the punishment. Shenji asked Cheng Dalei if the punishment was too harsh as he saw the two seemed quite sad. Cheng Dalei responded with subtlety, while Zhang Fei and Gao Hu exited the hall without saying anything. One of them remarked that they came out, another asked how it went, and someone else inquired if Cheng Dalei was angry. The two suddenly giggled, while someone called their names. Suddenly, they all celebrated. One person praised Gao Hu that he was awesome, as well as Zhang Fei, while others mentioned how they had broken into the enemy camp in the middle of the night and kidnapped the enemy, commending both of them as great. Another person suggested that next time, they shouldn't forget to share the fun with everyone, while some continued to commend them. Laughter filled the air as they celebrated. The two were tossed in the air as they were hailed for being amazing. Gao Hu humbly responded that it was nothing special, while Zhang Fei thanked their fellow villagers for their support. All the villagers cheered. The next day in Toad Village, Zhang Fei and Gao Hu were observed running in the field, with Gao Hu panting and puffing. Eventually, both Zhang Fei and Gao Hu shivered with exhaustion as people in the distance informed them that there were five more kilometers to go. Encouragements to keep running. Some people laughed at them, with one cheering Gao Hu and another person telling them to run faster. Exhausted, Gao Hu turned to them, calling them bastards for rejoicing over their misery. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei sighed and commented that his people were scatterbrained. He thought that it seemed the organizational structure of the village, rewards, punishments, discipline, and spiritual honor needed to be built, otherwise, they would always be a disorganized and undisciplined group. But he didn't want to take the long route to discipline them. Instead, he pondered that perhaps he could buy some useful books in the system store. Entering the system space, he looked for the system, asking if it was there as he needed to buy something. Continuing to look around, he searched for where she was and also sought out the raffle machine, trying to find them. The machine responded that he was there. Cheng Dalei's face comically expressed shock as he saw the machine playing. The machine asked him what he wanted. He asked the machine if it was playing Super Mario and if he guessed it correctly. The machine responded that the system space was usually too boring, and card games were a bit dull for him, so the big system designed a game with Cheng Dalei's memories to make it more enjoyable. Amazed, Cheng Dalei agreed and was left in awe. The machine glanced at him, explaining that it could only develop relatively small games, as complex ones consumed too much power. The machine tried to tempt Cheng Dalei to play a few rounds with him, 
but Cheng Dalei was still in a state of amazement. Hesitated, Cheng Dalei responded that it was not this time and that he had something to do. Maybe another time, laughing awkwardly. The machine asked him what he wanted from the system. Innocently, he informed the machine that he needed to buy something from the system, which watched the store, and he asked where the system was right now. The machine informed him that the system was working and should be in her lab. He assisted Cheng Dale in taking him there. While they were walking inside the system, Cheng Dale asked the machine about the structure of the system space, describing it as big and empty but containing many wonderful things. The machine responded that the system space was quite empty at its birth, and later the system slowly developed various functions to fill it. Additionally informed him that the developed functions, such as the summoning platform, the system shop, the war song system, the possession ability, and so on. The machine pointed up and said that they were all there, informing Cheng Dale that after the last crisis, the system cut them out and put them in isolated space bubbles. He informed Cheng Dale that the ball above them was one of them, and informed that it prevents glitches that could endanger the system itself. Cheng Dale inquired about the existence of space borders, causing the machine to affirm it and instruct Cheng Dale to follow him so he does not die flying out of space. The machine informed him that they arrived, saying that this was where the system usually worked. It requested access, stating the identity of the access rights holder as the host, and the request was approved. Cheng Dale was greeted as the host by it. The machine left Cheng Dale after unlocking the door and asked him to go to find the system so that he could resume playing video games. Cheng Dale opened the door and pondered the system's workplace. He saw the system concentrating on something. Meanwhile, the system was doing something while adding roses to it, causing a dramatic fade. She reflected on the fact that her experiment failed and that some key elements were still missing. When she glanced back and saw Cheng Dale, she greeted him with enthusiasm. The system inquired as to what had brought him there. Cheng Dale asked the system what she was working on. In response, the system chuckled and stated that she was working on developing features, but they were still in the conceptual phase, so she didn't know what they would be. She went on to say that she now built a mountain village and was not a lone wolf on the grassland. However, at that time, she gave him the war song function and the possession function, which were individually dependent, and she had to adjust those functions. With too many features, the system would be bloated and prone to error reporting and some features would have to be removed. Cheng Dale commented on how busy it sounded and commended the system for her efforts. The system winked, implying that he might think system administration is a joke. She explained that she didn't lie around all day thinking about sending him tasks. She asked him why he had come to meet her, and he replied that he believed their village needed spiritual and institutional construction. He informed her that he would purchase some books from her for future reference. He inquired if there should be books for sale in the system store. The system confirmed that there were books, but those were about the secret of martial arts. She suggested taking him somewhere else, as she believed that's where he might find what he was looking for. The system snapped her fingers and told him they were leaving, after which they vanished from her workplace and teleported to a library, leading Cheng Dale to tumble. He whined and questioned the system why she teleported him so suddenly, as he felt dizzy after teleporting. The system advised him to stop whining. She mentioned that they were in her study and private room, in the room of another bubble. Calmly, she asked how he expected to get in there if he didn't want to be teleported. She added that she, as a scholar, has no good ideas in her brain if a day is spent without reading a book, wondering how she could not have a book room, and proudly stated that she put all kinds of books and materials that she usually collected. Finally, she asked Cheng Dale if he found any suitable books. Amazed, Cheng Dale asked the system if there were all kinds of books there, wondering if the place was the library of the heavenly worlds that she built. The system questioned him how it was possible, stating that the world was full of information and that the books she amassed were beneficial to her. Cheng Dale responded in awe. He asked her if she had a book about military training and the military system, and if so, whether it had a search function. While she poured her coffee cup, the system verified it, stating that he only needed to think about the information he needed, and the books on the bookshelf would become the books he required. She also told Cheng Dale that the books in the system were best applied in steps, highlighting that he could not achieve his aim in just one step. The system and rules were dead, he must adjust according to the actual situation. The system informed him that many emperors wanted to develop a once-and-for-all system, like the first emperor of the Qin dynasty who wanted to develop a thousand generations, 
However, the Qin dynasty only lasted for 14 years. She reminded Cheng Dalei that the system had a shelf life, which Cheng Dalei acknowledged, and asked if she had a book on how to make hot weapons. He remarked that there was already gunpowder, and if they could start the age of firearms, it would be an overwhelming advantage over cold weapons. While the system was adding sugar to her coffee, she answered concerning the guns he described, asking if he meant the ancient rifles or current hot weapons. Intrigued, Cheng Dalei inquired if she had them and the system answered that they had. Nevertheless, she reminded him that she did not suggest he use modern weaponry in their era, leading him to question it. The system said that if Cheng Dalei wished to purchase, the system could swap modern guns, but it was too costly, with a starting price of hundreds of millions of fear points, and he responded that it was too expensive. She went on to say that because the period is too long, encompassing at least a thousand years of weaponry. The system can reproduce it, but it consumes too much power. Cheng Dalei questioned several of the earlier guns. The system responded that firepower with matchlock and flintlock is not even comparable to that of a strong bow. She revealed that in their world, there are hidden weapons experts who can kill people with pick leaves and cotton wads. She also noted that if he wanted to raise a group of muskets, he needed weapon resources, training materials, and logistics and that it was better to train a group of powerful archers, and mentioned that the weapons required a long process. She advised him to employ cold weapons instead. She advised him that even if he spent hundreds of millions of fear points on a design to buy a blueprint, he couldn't rely on a few blacksmiths to knock out the rifling and barrel barehanded, and she taunted Cheng Dalei that it wouldn't work. Then she said that in those chaotic times, there was no time for him to develop an industry, and without a complete industrial chain to sustain the weaponry, it was simply a flaming stick if it got broken. She continued that if he couldn't mass-produce, those flintlocks and weapons were no match for the powerful bow, leaving Cheng Dalei silent. The system reminded him that times had not changed yet. She inquired if Cheng Dalei found all the books he was looking for. Cheng Dalei listed the Art of War, 36 Stratagems, Guerrilla Warfare, Sun Tzu's Art of War, one of the seven military classics of ancient China, the 36 Stratagems, a Chinese essay used to illustrate a series of strategies in politics, wars, and civil interaction, making an implementation of the ancient dynastic system. The Legion and the Founder, a record of Greco-Roman infantry combat, Theory of War, Western Art of War. All of these should be in the Yu family army, Beiwei army. He confirmed that those were all the books he needed while showing a wide smile. The system confirmed and said to him that one copy was worth 300,000 fears. She thanked him for his patronage, which Cheng Dalei ridiculed as it was a bit expensive. He remarked that he used up all his fear points at once. The system countered him that knowledge is priceless, and the fee is only the cost of materializing the book into the present world. Curious, Cheng Dalei sneaked behind her, wondering about what the system was reading. He peeked at the pile of books on the table. Reading the titles, he discovered that the domineering president fell in love with her, self-cultivation of system elves, maintenance and system repair, 100 types of bug cards, motorcycle maintenance skills and meditation skills, ball of fat, and a hundred thousand reasons why, the truth about the world. He comically widened his eyes and pondered that the system has a wide range of interests. Meanwhile, back in their village, Zhang Fei and Gao Hu were breathing heavily after completing their punishment. Shenji scolded them and told them that they were disregarding the group, only knowing how to play the hero. He announced that this would be the end for the two, while both Zhang Fei and Gao Hu fainted, emitting a strong odor. Shenji declared to everyone that starting tomorrow morning, they would have to run like those two, prompting disdain and accusing Gao Hu of it. At the Snake Island Toad Village Night Council Chamber, Cheng Dalei mentioned the names of Liu Bei, Zhang Fei, Xilong, Fei Hu, and Fei Bao, claiming that they were not lacking in strength but had zero capacity to command troops in war. He proposed that they slowly polish their ability in that area. Xing Zai added that they needed to slowly get rid of their villainous nature, or they could only remain in the group as mobs which would lead to more casualties. In seriousness, Cheng Dalei asked Xing Zai if he had any suggestions about military management, and Wanner recorded everything. Xing Zai remarked that he studied the training method of the book Beiwei Army, which was close to his heart, and he advised that standards be followed. He emphasizes that there should be spearmen, swordsmen, shields, and archers, and suggested that Xilong, Guan Yu, Zhang Fei, Kin Man, Gao Fei, and Gao Hu lead each team. 
proposing that Liu Bei be in charge of the logistics teams. He further suggested that five people make a team, five teams make a company, four companies make a regiment, five regiments make a brigade, five brigades make a division, and five divisions make a corps. Furthermore, they were still a band of mountain bandits, and there was no reason to disguise it as a military stronghold. Wanner chimed in and asked Zing Zai if training them as elite soldiers according to his standards would be counterproductive and too restrictive. But Zing Zai responded that they must also be aware of the existence of military law. Wanner responded by stating that it is not good to rush things. Also, Cheng Dale suggested taking his time, emphasizing that the reward and punishment should be clear. Fu Dale intervened, mentioning that the reward should be based on merit. Zing Zai turned to face Fu Dale, noting that the punishment measures were just labor, lecture, and confinement, but these punishment methods were almost useless. He continued that some people are imprisoned, but they are not ashamed, instead, they are proud. But as soon as they come out, they act as if nothing happened. Wanner argues that a sense of respect and discipline are lacking in each man, but there was still brotherhood. Fu Dele mentioned that they use the collective punishment law. If one person commits a mistake, the whole team will be punished. At least they established the prestige of military law first. Xing Zai also noted that they have to train those people to work out in March. He suggested that Cheng Dale also needs to train along with them, which Cheng Dale acknowledged. Cheng Dale highlights the most important thing is to build a mountain village. The training can be put aside first. He continued, suggesting that they need to erase their stubbornness and retain their fierceness, just like sharpening a rusty iron knife to become sharper. Meanwhile, in the Kinchuan Mountain General's residence, Mo Mingmi questioned his soldiers whether they discovered who they were and where they came from. The soldier reported that they were called Alibaba 40 Arch Bandits, but it was certainly a fake name, and they occupied Snake Island. Mo Mingmi reacted by asking if they took care of the Snake King. Concerned, he asked about his stuff if it were not dug up. The soldier introduced as Yan Dai responded that it was not clear, but there were not many signs of battle on the island. They didn't seem to be dead, maybe the Snake King himself left. According to the description of Zhonglong's subordinates, they roughly painted the appearance of the people who broke into the fortress. He added that they heard the two people call each other's names, one called Gao Hu and the other one called Zhang Fei. Yan Dai added that according to their investigation, they were sure that they were from the Toad Village, Cheng Dalei's men Gao Hu and Zhang Fei. He bowed, confirming that Cheng Dalei was there. Mo Mingmi inquired about the number of people under Cheng Dalei, prompting Yan Dai to confirm that they should be around one or two thousand people, which made Mo Mingmi smile evilly. With a malicious look, Mo Mingmi noted that it was good timing. Yan Dai told Mo Mingmi that the other side was small in number but still could not be taken lightly. After all, remarking that he was Cheng Dalei. The evil aura on Mo Mingmi's face was apparent as he agreed, suggesting that they should eliminate Cheng Dalei before he gained a firm foothold. However, Yan Dai informed him that the envoy of the Ring tribe was still in the city and asked if Cheng Dalei wanted to inform them about the news. Mo Mingmi responded that they shouldn't cause trouble for now, emphasizing the need to pay attention to the Ring tribe's movements, as they have long coveted the iron ore. He mentioned that their elite soldiers in the city couldn't make a move, which Yan Dai acknowledged. Mo Mingmi threw the images, instructing Yan Dai to mobilize the 18 lieutenants of Kinchuan to attack Snake Island. He specified that each family must send no less than 500 troops, and they must arrive within 10 days. He added that whoever could bring Cheng Dalei's head would be rewarded with a thousand gold, 500 sets of armor, half a year of tax exemption, and the title of the head of the 18 lieutenants. Yan Dai commended him as wise. After their conversation, Mo Mingmi pondered about Cheng Dalei, calling his name while gripping his sword. He acknowledged Cheng Dalei was smart and that he had come to Kinchuan Mountain without official credentials. Mo Mingmi stabbed a picture and continued to reflect that Cheng Dalei had finally arrived after much anticipation. He pondered that since Cheng Dalei came to Kinchuan and couldn't imagine him leaving, Contemplating the situation, Mo Mingmi thought that if he killed Cheng Dalei, he could help the Minister of Eng Longting and sell Cheng Dalei's head to the Ring tribe as a favor. The photo he stabbed was of Cheng Dalei, and Mo Mingmi burst out laughing. Mo Mingmi's military orders spread throughout the Qin River within days. In another place, a soldier reported to other soldiers that Mo Mingmi ordered. All 18 mountain strongholds began to count their troops and prepare for the attack. A lieutenant ordered his 800 muster troops to follow him, while he ordered 1,000 military troops to target Snake Island. At the command, the 18 lieutenants of the Kinchuan gathered in great numbers. In the prison at Toad Village, Zhonglong in prison growled in his sleep. Shenji called Cheng Dalei, mentioning that Zhonglong was awake. 
While Zhang Long was just regaining consciousness, he saw Cheng Dalei ask Shen Ji if he memorized his lines. Shen Ji reassured him that he remembered them well. Zhang Long angrily called Cheng Dalei, advising him to be smart and let him go. He warned him if they didn't recognize the person backing him. Sarcastically, Shen Ji replied that it was Mo Mingmi backing him, adding that they had come to ask Zhang Long about him. Frustrated, Zhang Long asked if they wanted to know something about Mo Mingmi and if they intended to oppose him. He inquired about their identities and their intentions. Cheng Dalei responded that since Zhang Long asked in good faith, Shen Ji continued that they would be gracious enough to tell him. Cheng Dalei began to recite their lines that their goal was to save the world from destruction, followed by Shen Ji stating that their purpose was to maintain peace in the world. Shen Ji continued, explaining that they aimed to realize the evil of love and truth. Cheng Dalei added a touch of humor by mentioning their cute and charming villain role. Proudly, Cheng Dalei declared himself as the Toad King, and Shen Ji proclaimed his role as the Jade-Faced Military Strategist. Cheng Dalei announced that they were the Toad Village, shuttling back and forth in King New Mountain. Shen Ji added that a glorious morning awaited them. As their line concluded, Cheng Dalei kept agreeing with Shen Ji, who remained proud of himself, while Zhang Long expressed confusion. Cheng Dalei complimented Shen Ji, acknowledging that he remembered it well and noting the progress he had made. Unable to contain himself, Zhang Long interjected, questioning Cheng Dalei's identity, and noting that if he was the one who assassinated Long Ting, and the King of the Rings. With a touch of aggression, Shen Ji confirmed to Zhang Long that Cheng Dalei was, indeed, the mountain bandit known for consuming 10 pounds of human flesh and drinking 2 pounds of human blood at every meal. Cheng Dalei, seemingly amused, playfully informed Zhang Long that Shen Ji served as his royal chef, boasting that his best dish was the infamous human feast. He advised Zhang Long to behave. Zhang Long yelled at them, saying that they were mistaken. He said that both Cheng Dalei and Shen Ji were handsome and first-class characters, but he told them that they just looked so ordinary. Feeling down, Cheng Dalei considered that every person has a different understanding of handsomeness and told Zhang Long that he would show his ordinary sword. Zhang Long confirmed that he was Cheng Dalei. He was waiting for him for an eternity, and finally, he was there. He told him that he was not lying to him. He admitted that he saw Mo Mingmi in a bad light for a long time. He had been waiting for Cheng Dalei to come to Kinchuan to replace Mo Mingmi, and Cheng Dalei questioned him. Shen Ji, feeling proud, thought to himself that, as he expected, the opponent was convinced of his personality and charm even before the torture began. On the other hand, Cheng Dalei felt uncertain. Wondering if this was already a confession, as he still had ABCD programs to use. Zhang Long asked Cheng Dalei what else he wanted to hear. He promised to tell him everything and suggested starting with how many wives Mo Mingmi had. Cheng Dalei deflected the question. Instead, he asked about the distribution of nearby forces, the identities of the 18 lieutenants, how many men each lieutenant commanded, and which ones were more powerful. Zhang Long, seemingly cooperative, claimed to know everything and was willing to share all the information. Zhang Long added that if Mo Mingmi ordered an attack, the 18 lieutenants were expected to arrive in a few days. He specifically mentioned the nearest lieutenant, Du Nguyen, born a water bandit, commanding at least 2,000 elite soldiers. Zhang Long revealed that Du Nguyen was Mo Mingmi's adopted son, making him the likely first to attack. He further disclosed that he knew Mo Mingmi had a mistress in the village outside and questioned whether they should catch the mistress to threaten him. Feeling shame at Zhang Long's suggestion, Cheng Dalei couldn't help but question if he was a grown man who goes after women. Shen Ji chimed in with a remark, questioning if Zhang Long was still a man. Uncertain, Zhang Long responded that ruthlessness is the mark of a truly great man, highlighting that they were mountain bandits. Cheng Dalei clarified that they don't do that, emphasizing that if people found out, he wouldn't know how to go on living. He urged Zhang Long to continue telling them what he knew. After talking to Zhang Long, curious, Shen Ji inquired of Cheng Dalei how much truth he believed was in Zhang Long's words. Cheng Dalei responded that Zhang Long's words were full of emotion, and they couldn't believe everything he said. He asked Shen Ji, seeking his opinion on whether they could withstand the first wave of the attack. Shen Ji responded, expressing skepticism about their ability to easily withstand it. Referring to Zhang Long's information, he highlighted Du Nguyen as the best among the water bandits, particularly good at conquering shores. Shen Ji pointed out that although Snake Island seemed surrounded by water, appearing as a natural barrier for water bandits familiar with such terrain, it posed no obstacle at all. Acknowledging the justification of the analysis, Cheng Dalei expressed concern. Shen Ji continued, noting that the mountain village wall was not yet finished, making the fight difficult once the enemy landed on the coast and Cheng Dalei confirmed. 
he expressed concern that it seemed like it was going to be a challenging battle. Just then, Cheng Dale called everyone's attention. When Kin Man inquired about his orders, Cheng Dale instructed them to cease the construction of the fortress and organize everyone to create Spanish riders. Emphasizing that more would be better, he conveyed the urgency of being prepared for war. His command was acknowledged by everyone. Take the Spanish riders by boat to the riverfront sites while the tide is out. Then place them in the shallows of all waters in the Toad Village. It took several days to surround all the shallow parts of Snake Island with them. During floods, the Spanish rider is flooded by the river. Only at low tide, the Spanish rider formation is visible. Some men with good eyes were assigned to keep watch on the high places of the Snake Island. A few days later, a person pointed towards the water and urged everyone to look and check it out. Early in the morning, a person instructed everyone to relay the message that the enemy was approaching, urgently calling for the horn to be blown to prepare for war. While someone mentioned that the first wave of the attack was coming, as the horn resounded loudly, instructions were swiftly issued for everyone to get ready for battle. Cheng Dale announced that Du Nguyen pirates had arrived. He urged everyone to get ready and that the enemy was there. One person cursed upon seeing many boats, questioning how many people they sent. Kin Man shared information that he heard from the dragon in the cloud, mentioning that Du Nguyen was Mo Mingmi's stepson, and the army under him was well-trained and fierce. Concerned, Cheng Dale remarked that this time Mo Mingmi could expect some excitement, as Du Nguyen seemed to be going all out. Meanwhile, in the Du family, there were 2,500 strong sailors. Du Nguyen mentioned that he originally wanted to surprise them by attacking earlier, but their reactions were quick. He expressed satisfaction that they arrived in advance, giving them a chance to finish preparing for a bitter battle. With determination, Du Nguyen commanded his forces to go at maximum speed, board Snake Island, and capture it in one swoop. At the same time, Kin Man expressed concern to Cheng Dale about the enemy charging over. Cheng Dale reassured him, urging him not to rush, and ordered Kin Man to instruct the strong bow teams to get ready to fire as soon as the enemy landed. Kin Man quickly commanded his men to get ready. On the opposite side, one of Du Nguyen's men reported that their boat had hit the shallows, preventing them from going any further. Du Nguyen ordered his troops to unsheathe their blades, drop the smaller boats, and have teams of five people aboard the island. He also instructed them to clear the way for others and protect them as they swam to shore. Du Nguyen announced the attack. Du Nguyen's troops shouted battle cries as they advanced to the shore. Meanwhile, Kin Man reported that the strong bow team was in position. Cheng Dale advised him to target the people on the boats. Kin Man commanded them to fire and to shoot them down. Meanwhile, Du Nguyen's troops kept advancing while holding up their shields as they faced the barrage of arrows. On the other hand, Kin Man swiftly directed Team 1 to fall back while instructing Team 2 to take their positions and continue shooting at the advancing enemy forces. The troops of Du Nguyen were perplexed as their boats seemed to be stuck and unable to move. Panic set in as they realized there was something under their boats. Du Nguyen's troops wondered why their boat was not moving, noting that they got stuck and that there was something under their boats. Someone mentioned that there were reefs under the boats, while others disagreed, suggesting that it might be wooden spikes placed in the water. As the enemy boats got stuck, Kin Man exclaimed that their plan was working. However, Cheng Dale still cautioned that it wouldn't hold them for long and urged his teams to shoot them down quickly. He commanded Team 1 and Team 2 archers to fire. Meanwhile, Du Nguyen's troops became increasingly panicked, with some cursing as they could not move forward. Du Nguyen reminded them that they were sailors and questioned whether they grew soft from living a peaceful life. He still ordered his troops to get in the water and swim to shore. His troops were prompt to swim, while Du Nguyen commanded them to charge. Tin Man noticed and informed Cheng Dale that Du Nguyen's troops jumped into the water, and the arrows could not hit them. Cheng Dale ordered his archers to wait until the enemy emerged from the water. He instructed everyone else to ready their weapons. Everyone could tell that the situation would turn into a brutal melee, and that they would form a wall of flesh and blood. Du Nguyen was still in the water, commanding his troops to kill and charge forward. His troops charged, using their shields to defend against arrows. One of Du Nguyen's troops noticed something. He pondered something moving on his legs. He saw a snake beneath him, and before he could react, fear showed on his face as he realized it was a snake. The snake attacked him, causing him to scream. Other troops panicked and warned everyone about the snake and that there were so many of them. Screams were everywhere, making everyone terrified of the upcoming snakes, while some still warned others to watch out. With the emergence of the snakes, the sailors now had to block arrows flying from the sky and watch out for snakes under the water. 
the situation turned into chaos, and the first wave of human lives was lost. Amidst the chaos, his troops urgently informed him of a snake presence ahead. Initially stating hundreds, he quickly corrected himself, emphasizing that there were thousands of snakes. Some suggested that they should retreat, emphasizing the danger of an infestation of snakes in the water, and that forcing their way to shore would result in losing hundreds of men. While they still warned others to watch out for the arrows, the distance of a hundred meters away from the shore became a death zone. Bodies were floating, while some troops urged others to retreat and get back on the boat quickly. Du Nguyen yelled at Cheng Dalei from a distance, informing him that Cheng Dalei was using such a tactic and promising to return, asking Cheng Dalei if he heard him. Everyone on the island was in a state of confusion. Someone wondered why they fled. Then the first attack from the 18 families of colonels ended without a single drop of blood touching dry land. One of Cheng Dalei's men cheered for their victory, while others taunted the enemies and fled with their tails tucked between their legs. Shenji questioned the sudden appearance of snakes, expressing relief that they weren't present when the spikes were set. Disbelief, Gao who wondered why it was always someone shouting words whenever they ran away. Gao Fei answered that it was to save some face. Cheng Dalei acknowledged their luck with the snakes in the water, but warned that they needed to prepare against the snake's poison in future attacks. He emphasized the importance of completing the construction of the fortress and suggested leaving men to act as scouts there. Cheng Dalei informed them that they only had around 2,000 people and it was far from enough. He proposed going to nearby villages to recruit anyone. He promptly ordered Gao Fei and Kin Man, assigning them the task of scouting the surroundings, alerting that the enemy flanked them. While Gao Hu received the responsibility of recruiting workers, they confirmed Cheng Dalei's orders. After dividing their tasks, a King region, King Yi village, suddenly, a person from the village rushed in, reporting trouble and the presence of an army that captured people. The villagers, filled with fear, questioned if it was the King region government again. Panic ensued, and someone urgently shouted for everyone to run while others questioned the heavens, wondering why their lives had to be so difficult. Some stated to not leave even the chickens behind. The horsemen approached their village, calling out to the residents. It turned out that it was Gao who accompanied by his men. He ordered them to surround the village and bring everyone outside. Gao who intimidated the villagers by telling them that they thought they could escape by hiding underground. Terrified screams, a person pleaded to spare their lives out of fear. He sternly ordered a person not to run ordering his men to apprehend them all. Terrified, the children remained silent as they looked outside. Gao Hu inquired if everyone was present and insisted that they listen carefully. He proclaimed that they were under the command of Cheng Dalei from the Toad Village. Haughtily, he informed that Cheng Dalei wanted men to work for them. Promising food, drinks, and payment in silver, he warned them not to disagree and that they shouldn't blame his sword for being sharp. The elders of the village responded that they had elders and children under their care. He pleaded with Gao Hu to spare them, acknowledging Gao Hu's magnanimity as he begged for their humble lives. In a stern tone, Gao Hu declared that he was not there to negotiate but to kidnap people. He ordered them to tie the villagers up, leaving them in a state of hopelessness. However, one person became enraged and declared that he would fight them while holding a stick, and someone identified the enraged man as Jiang San and told him that he was insane. Jiang San bravely launched an attack against Gao Hu. However, Gao Hu swiftly subdued Jiang San and ordered that he be brought along. Cheng Dalei's soldiers stood out, claiming that Cheng Dalei merely wanted them to work and not damage or loot their village, while Gao Hu instructed his men to take them away. Meanwhile, a kid inquired with the village chief about whether his father would be back. The village chief confirmed, telling the kid that they were working for a bit. However, a man cursed, mentioning that the government people took his son away a year ago, and he has not heard from him since. He sighed and questioned the heavens. The village chief disagreed with him, providing an example of when Zhang San attacked earlier, stating that they only knocked him and didn't take his life. He expressed hope that Cheng Dalei would indeed keep his word. Later that moment, at the Toad Village, Cheng Dalei was busy looking at the blueprint. Gao Hu informed Cheng Dalei that they were back and they found over a hundred men. He inquired about Cheng Dalei's next target for their kidnapping. Perplexed, Cheng Dalei corrected him, stating that they were not kidnapping but recruiting workers. He informed him that they already had enough laborers and there was no need to go out again. Gao Hu relayed information he gathered from the villages, mentioning that people were saying Mo Mingmi had also gone to kidnap people, and those individuals were never seen again. Acknowledged about the matter, Cheng Dalei expressed his disapproval and noted that some only knew how to exploit workers without any sense of sustainability. 
He ordered Gao Hu to bring the people to eat first. Gao Hu questioned the order, and Cheng Dalei irritably responded, dismissing it as nonsense and questioning how people could work on an empty stomach. Moving on, Shenji began calling out to the people, starting with the clay masons, instructing them to step forward. He asked for carpenters, prompting them to take a step forward. Shenji informed them that they were in a hurry, so they would have to work three shifts throughout the night. He assured them to relax, stating that they wouldn't mistreat them. When night fell, Shenji instructed them to start working. One person asked Jiang San about his thoughts on the bandits that kidnapped them, given that they provided food and new sets of clothes, claiming it was some kind of uniform. In a snobbish manner, Jiang San questioned that they were simply being made to do manual labor. The person persisted, wondering if they would be released once the work was done. Jiang San replied that they could only find out. Despite the doubts, Jiang San acknowledged that the food that night was excellent, especially the white buns which they hadn't had in a long time. The person wondered if maybe the bandits were not all bad. However, he remained reluctant, emphasizing that even so, they were still bandits, and they shouldn't be tempted, suggesting that they just did their work half-heartedly and made do, a sentiment and Jiang San agreed. Jiang San found it weird that his bricklaying work was unusually accurate that day, and the person agreed, feeling that the task seemed easier. With a proud expression, the system giggled, revealing that there was a village buff in effect, swift construction, and that the level 2 village was almost complete. Each of the 18 lieutenants of Kinchuan occupied a territory in the area. They did not interfere with each other, and they paid their monthly harvest to Mo Mingmi. Today, they received a military order from Mo Mingmi to send troops to gather at Kinchuan Mountain. Kinchuan Mountain 18 Lieutenants Temporary Camp a soldier informed the lieutenants to go inside quickly as Yan Dai was already waiting for them. One of the lieutenants wondered if it was Yan Dai himself at the moment. Another lieutenant also wondered if Yan Dai, who was with Mo Mingmi, was a big man who should not be offended. Inside the camp, Yan Dai greeted them, mentioning that they were all there under the military orders of Mo Mingmi. He assumed that everyone had heard of Cheng Dalei's reputation and detailed Cheng Dalei's actions, stating of killing Longting, sneaking into the grassland to kill the King of the Ring tribe, and now coming to Kinchuan. Yan Dai added that there were robberies in Heijia City, Zhonglong was captured, and Cheng Dalei wanted to control both water and land routes. He informed them of the many things that happened in just a month. One of the lieutenants commented that if they allowed Cheng Dalei to stay in Kinchuan any longer, he would eventually seize all their territory sooner or later. Yan Dai revealed that Mo Mingmi intended to gather the strength of the 18 mountain strongholds to kill Cheng Dalei. Tao Bing asked Yan Dai if he truly wanted to escalate the situation, noting that as far as he knew, Cheng Dalei's forces consisted of only 2,000 people, with about a thousand warriors among them. Yan Dai brought up Du Nguyen, mentioning him who attacked in advance with more than 2,000 people, and he could not even board the island. He pointed to a map detailing the topography of Snake Island and instructed them to prepare enough real gear to make sufficient rafts for an army of 10,000 people to reach the island. Yan Dai specifically told Taobing that he would lead the team at that time. He also informed them that Mo Mingmi had declared that those involved in the siege would be exempt from taxes for three months. Furthermore, whoever obtained Cheng Dalei's head would be promoted to become the head of the 18 lieutenants. The lieutenants acknowledged and obediently followed Yan Dai's orders. Ten days later, the construction of the second level Toad Village was finally completed. Half of the trees on the island were cut down, prioritizing the construction of the outer wall arrow towers, traps, reefs, etc. Then there is a gathering hall medical center, summoning platform, and watchtower. The mountain village is surrounded by mountains on both sides and cliffs on one side. The last side was a plain, so a tall wall was built. The outskirts of the island were built with both light and dark docks. Cheng Dalei contemplated the construction being finally complete, and the efforts of working in three shifts were not in vain. A beep sound received the second level mountain village construction completed, and the summoning platform function was opened. Cheng Dalei examined the village profile, noting its address as Kinchuan Snake Island with a population of 2,513 people. He checked his task, which required a population of 5,000 to upgrade the village to level 3. The reward for completing this task was Martial World's Rumors, a skill that would allow him to know everything about the world without leaving. Reflecting on the reward, Cheng Dalei considered the advantage of gaining information from all sides in advance. However, he speculated that the accuracy might not be too high, requiring screening and analysis. Suddenly, the system called out to him. She asked Cheng Dalei how he managed to build a second-level mountain village so quickly. 
Cheng Dalei responded by wondering if the system would develop again, expressing concern that if she continued like that, she would become an old woman. The system explained that the sprite had reached adulthood and would naturally stabilize its form. Moreover, with the increase in the mountain village level, Cheng Dalei's strength would also improve. She gave him his rewards. Another beep sounded, indicating that the third level mountain village constructions were completed, and Cheng Dalei's power had increased. Cheng Dalei contemplated the increase in power and questioned the system about his strength, agility and other aspects being raised to a sufficient level, would he break through to the top and become a supreme master? The system explained to Cheng Dalei that becoming a supreme master was not as simple, emphasizing that supreme mastery needs a breakthrough in martial arts skills out of their skills with brute force. One cannot become supreme. Excited, Cheng Dalei mentioned that he still had a lottery draw, and decided to use it immediately. The system announced the lottery machine to come out. Cheng Dalei stated that he would see if he could get something good this time. As they impatiently waited, they exchanged awkward smiles. However, despite their patience, the lottery machine still did not come out. Pissed, the system informed him that she needed a moment as it seemed the lottery machine wasn't responding. She went back to the system world and informed him that she checked what was going on. She disappeared from Cheng Dalei's sight, leaving him dismayed. Inside the system world, the lottery machine was playing a game, taunting his opponent for being weak. He laughed and told his opponent who the boss was. Suddenly, the system appeared behind him, calling his name. With annoyance, she scolded the machine and angrily grabbed him, emphasizing that he was playing video games again. She sternly told him it was time to work, while the machine expressed confusion. A couple of orbs shone down from above the lottery machine. Four orbs became brighter as gusts formed around it. The lottery machine informed Hart that it was done. A notification appeared stating that the draw battle song background music titled Surrounded could be used to add negative buffs and debuffs to the enemy army, and that the condition could only be used when surrounded by enemy troops. Cheng Dalei stated that it was actually a battlefield BGM and wondered why there was a use of condition, as the conditions appeared to be quite harsh, and Hart responded that the BGM must use conditions. Hart informed him that he could also play a song for others at the funeral, as for example, today was a good day, and see if others couldn't beat him up, as a notification popped up stating that a battle song was added to favorites. The lottery machine chuckled as he asked Hart if he could go back first, since his job was done. Annoyed, Hart fumed. She scolded the lottery machine, saying he only knew how to play video games and couldn't help her with her work and she wondered if he knew how busy she was. She also mentioned how he had no idea how expensive salt and oil were, despite using the system's power to create new games every day. She grabbed the lottery machine and told him she would take care of him when they got back, while the lottery machine requested Cheng Dalei's help. Cheng Dalei discovered that the required population to upgrade to level 3 Mountain Village was 5,000, and the last time he was in King Niu Mountain, it only required 1,000 people and now it needed 5,000. Gao Feibao appeared in a hurry, addressing Cheng Dalei. He informed him that he had just received word that Mo Mingmi had sent 18 lieutenants to join forces, and that their total number of troops was more than 10,000, and that he believed that they would come any time in the next few days. Cheng Dalei wondered if it was because of the martial world rumors, and he asked Gao Feibao where he got the information. Gao Feibao explained that it came from a brother who went out to buy something and got back with the news. He went on to say that they had heard them say that the army was collecting realgar, small boats, and bamboo rafts and that they were their target, and he asked Cheng Dalei if they could hold them back if they truly had 10,000 men. Cheng Dalei stated that they would be able to hold them back because they had already repelled 100,000 ring tribe men. When asked if he was still afraid of a mere 10,000 army, he continued that it was just that they couldn't keep defending passively any longer, and they needed to beat them up once and for all. Then suddenly, Cheng Dalei had an idea. He instructed Gao Feibao to arrange for the brothers to tie a thousand scarecrows overnight, as well as to allow Guan Yu, Liu Bei, Zhang Fei, and Zhao Zilong to come to him because he would arrange another task for them, and Gao Feibao agreed. After a while, Zhang Fei told everyone to stand up properly and stay in line, asking them not to sway left or right. A man asked Zhang Fei what they were doing. Another man behind him assumed that they were either letting them go or allowing them to join them as bandits, while another man assumed that it was killing a donkey as soon as it left, and that now that their work was done, they wouldn't be needed anymore. Zhang Fei told them not to squeeze up and come at them one by one, and he called for someone to come first. Zhu Shenji asked the man his name, and the man responded that his name was Zhao Sanjuang. 
He asked him where he came from, and the man told him that he was from Greenleaf Town. Zhu Shenji asked him what his job was, and the man responded that he was a mason. Liu Bei chimed in, stating that a mason's wage was one string. People around Zhao Sanzhuang said they'd heard of people being fed before being killed, but he'd never heard of people being paid before being killed. Liu Bei told him to hurry up and line up once they got their money and wait until the boat had enough people to send them back. Zhao Sanzhuang asked Liu Bei if he really let them go back. Liu Bei asked if he didn't want to go back because they were recruiting now, and if he wanted to sign up, he could stand over the recruitment area, and Zhao Sanzhuang told him to forget it. Zhao Sanzhuang asked Liu Bei if they could still work in the future because he could still come if there was work. People agreed that if there were three meals a day and money, he could work the next time and come, and others agreed that they would come as well. As Liu Bei handed them coins, he told them not to worry. He also told them that Toad Village would undoubtedly need their help in the future, and that they would not let them work for nothing. Zhu Shenji chimed in, saying that as the saying goes, a relative afar is less useful than a close neighbor. He also stated that they would settle here in the near future, and that they would all be neighbors, and that if anyone evil abused their power, the Toad Village would act on behalf of everyone. He pulled on the rope, causing the banner to fall out. He yelled what was written on the banner to enforce justice on behalf of heaven. Zhu Shenji told them that Toad Village had come, and Kinchuan would be peaceful, and they would get justice. He went on to say that he would guarantee to send them all back safely. Zhu Shenji smirked as he stated that even gods couldn't stop what he said, which made the crowd cheer. A voice addressed Zhu Shenji, telling him to wait. He informed him that Cheng Dalei gave orders that they couldn't let them go like that. Zhu Shenji petrified as he wondered what he was saying. The people recognized Gao Fei Bao as the mountain bandit who previously captured the people, wondering what they wanted, while others pondered if they were going back on their words and if they would be killed, believing that none of the bandits were good, believing that they had already changed. Gao Fei Bao told them not to panic because their leader did not want to make things difficult for them. He simply wanted to ask them to do one more favor and assured them that they would be paid afterward, which prompted the crowd to ask if there was any more work to be done and what else they wanted them to do. Gao Fei Bao informed them that Cheng Dalei wanted to invite them to be a mass actor. A few days later, a bird soared above the sky, and early morning, the morning fog had not yet disappeared. A ship sailed making a water wave. The 18 lieutenants gathered their troops and attacked. A voice from the watchtower announced that they were coming. A man stated that they looked like more than 10,000 people, telling others not to guard the coast and retreat inside the wall as Cheng Dalei had ordered. They told others to burn the smoke signal and retreat in a hurry. A voice told Lieutenant Zhu that he heard Cheng Dale was sinister, cunning, and scheming, and asked if it wasn't too risky for them to rush. Lieutenant Zhu believed that the more cunning he was, the more it meant that he was not strong enough to deal with their army head-on. He told them to go straight to the island because the Toad Village only had a thousand or two thousand men, and they had many times more. He commanded them to pass down his orders and advance at full speed. A voice reported that the ships carrying Rilger approached the shallow water and sprinkled Rilger to open the way, while others instructed to drop the raft and land quickly while keeping a watch out for snakes. Lieutenant Zhu ordered his men to get to the island and surround and kill Cheng Dalei. As his soldiers marched and chanted the word kill, he advised them to spread out and block the path around the island so Cheng Dalei could not escape. A man reported that something was ahead, which made Lieutenant Zhu wonder what was ahead and why he was panicking. The man proceeded to report that there was a built-up mountain village up ahead. Lieutenant Zhu saw the fortified village and was dumbfounded. One of his men wondered how it could be possible given that it had only been a few days, and Lieutenant Zhu wondered how it could be possible given that the last time Du Nguyen attacked the Toad Village, he informed him that the Toad Village had not even built a good outer wall. He asked his men what he waited for and told them to bring the ladders and wagons from the ship and assemble them right away to launch an attack, which the man agreed to. A soldier told Lieutenant Zhu to look above, which made him curious about what it was. He wondered what the tall platform on the wall was for and who those people were up there. A man expressed that it was so high. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dalei if they really wanted to be on such a tall platform to summon wind and rain. And Cheng Dalei agreed and asked him if he heard that the higher the platform, the higher the mana, and the more powerful the spell. Zhu Shenji wondered why they didn't just defend the village as usual, given that there were only 10,000 people, and they even defended against the Ring tribe's 100,000 soldiers. Cheng Dalei explained that they could defend the village as usual, but he didn't think the miscellaneous troops were as strong as the Ring tribe, and he wanted to do more than just hold them down this time. 
Zhu Shenji stated that he was not like him, who could summon wind and rain, and he asked Cheng Dalei why he had to do it as well. And Cheng Dalei replied that it was because he was his strategist, and he could do a showy thing once, and that he would give him this opportunity. He worried about being shot by an arrow up there. However, Cheng Dalei assured him that he would look after Xiao Ling'er and find a new strategist so that he could die in peace, prompting Zhu Shenji to curse him. Cheng Dalei announced that their audience had arrived, asking Zhu Shenji if he was ready to start and if he remembered his lines, and Zhu Shenji sighed. A soldier recognized them and informed his friends that it was Cheng Dalei, the person on the wanted list, and the person next to him was the legendary Jade Face strategist Zhu Shenji. He wondered what they were doing. The soldiers wondered if Zhu Shenji started the ceremony with his posture. Zhu Shenji clapped his hand above his head and shouted. He yelled that the fogs would rise, that the dragon and tiger would be at war, and that the thunder god and goddess of lightning ought to heed his orders, and that when the command arrived, they should execute it with urgency. Hart asked the snake to lend her his power for a while, at which point a system message appeared, stating that the use of the white snake's gift using its ability smoke for once. He released the fog to arise. The soldiers wondered what was going on as it was getting foggy. Some wondered if it was an immortal spell and a real fog, while others stated that they had heard that Cheng Dalei could use immortal magic to summon the wind and rain, as well as invite gods to come down to earth. One soldier pondered if the situation could be because of what Zhu Shenji was doing. Lieutenant Zhu yelled, telling his men not to be afraid, believing that they might have mystified them. He ordered his archers to shoot him down. Plenty of arrows flew in the air, making a swooshing noise. The arrows continued to travel towards Cheng Dalei and Zhu Shenji. Cheng Dalei observed the arrow, and Zhu Shenji began to panic. Cheng Dalei grabbed the hilt of his sword. He released his heart's beat as one skill. Lieutenant Zhu yelled that he didn't care what kind of immortal or demon Cheng Dalei was, he would take his head that day. He ordered his men to attack. The soldiers chanted kill as they charged. The soldiers attacked and yelled at each other to attack the village. Lieutenant Zhu ordered the shield soldiers to cover the boarding ladder forward, and the first to reach the top would be rewarded richly. Zhu Shenji informed Cheng Dalei that they were coming, and Cheng Dalei told him not to panic and prepare for battle. The soldiers continued their attack. The men from the Toad Village ordered the others to quickly put all the scarecrows up against the wall, and they agreed. A man asked Zhu Shenji if he was going to send them to war, while the others begged for them to be spared. While someone expressed that he was an 80-year-old mother and three small children under him, pleading that he couldn't go to war and die. Kin Man yelled at them, telling them that he did not ask them to go to war, and that they should just hide behind them and sound the gongs and war drums, and those without the gongs and war drums should shout hysterically to attack, and the louder the roar, informing them that the higher the reward. He told them that even if they didn't want to fight, they should just open their mouths and shout, and ask them if they lost the courage to do so because of the oppression they usually suffer. He told them to let their anger out and direct it at their enemies, who usually oppress them, and to look under the tower for Mo Mingmi's men. Kin Man asked if they could give him a roar, and they did and yelled to attack. In the thick fog, the walls swarmed with people, and the sounds of the attack were loud. The soldiers assumed that they had more than a thousand people. A voice ordered the bow unit to move forward. And in addition to the scarecrows and civilians on the walls, 500 elite warriors were assigned to guard the walls. Cheng Dalei ordered them to draw their bows and arrows and shoot at will. The bow unit was commanded to aim, and moments later, they were ordered to release, while the soldiers below yelled at each other to watch out for arrows. They told each other to block the arrows and watch out, while some blamed others for telling them to block the arrows, while others hurt their knee because he was hit by an arrow, and a system notification stated that fear points had increased. Cheng Dalei thought that although the people wore the usual military armor, they were essentially a group of mountain and water bandits, claiming that their reaction and their cooperation on the battlefield and the quality of the individual soldiers couldn't be compared to that of the rings. He claimed that they all fought in their own way, without any cooperation, and that they were too weak to win a war with numerical superiority alone, like a scattered plate of sand. He claimed that arrows in the fog were only averagely effective and could not achieve greater results, while someone on the battlefield ordered his men to stand firm and quickly knock down from the wall. Lieutenant Zhu ordered the siege wagon to break open the gates. The soldiers screamed to charge as they attacked. A voice informed Cheng Dalei that the soldiers were going to start attacking the village and there were too many of them, and sooner or later they would enter the village, while someone ordered the bow units to continue to shoot arrows and fire at will to suppress them. Panicking, Zhu Shenji thought it was over, but Cheng Dalei told him not to panic and to keep firing arrows while allowing them to get closer. Zhu Shenji informed him that it looked bad, as they were already smashing at the gate, 
and that the gates were about to be broken as there were too many enemies, and their men on the walls wouldn't last long. A huge explosion was heard. The villagers yelled at each other not to let them get up and kill them while yelling at the soldiers to get off. Cheng Dalei told Zhu Shenji that it was now time. Zhu Shenji stepped forward. He clapped and asked the heavenly thunder to rise and for the heavenly soldiers to descend. Kin Man yelled at the soldiers to eat his heavenly thunder and told his men to blow them up as they threw some boxes. Another explosion was heard below, making the soldiers scream. Continuous explosions were made, sending some soldiers flying. The soldiers thought the gods were angry and recognized the heavenly thunder as a god's spell, while a system message appeared stating that fear points had increased. They realized that it was gunpowder and told others not to panic and attack. On a far distance, Zhao Zilong and the others watched as the explosions went on. Zhao Zilong recognized the sounds as explosions, and Gao Fei who recognized it as Cheng Dali's signal. Zhang Fei smirked and informed them that they were split into four groups, and Guan Yu realized that it was now their turn to play. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Zhu ordered his men not to retreat, and whoever withdrew would be beheaded. The explosions continued on the battlefield. Some people pushed forward despite the explosives, while others tried to escape the blasts, and the coalition army of 18 lieutenants was in chaos at that point. Arrows came in flying, making a swooshing noise, and at that moment, countless arrows flew out of the dense fog. Soldiers panicked, informing others that enemies ambushed them at their backs, ordering everyone to turn around and defend, while others wondered where those ambushers had come from while others made stories that their military strategist had just cast a spell, an incantation to summon the heavenly army, and made the others fear yelling that the heavenly army arrived. Zhao Zilong and the others attacked as he yelled at his brothers that at that moment, they were the soldiers of heaven. He ordered them to break their formation. A soldier reported that there were enemies in the back, and the estimate was at least a thousand people. Four hidden units of 400 men each sneaked up from behind. Lieutenant Zhu was perplexed as to what was going on because he believed there were only one or two thousand people in Toad Village. He was also perplexed as to where they had come from. Guan Yu told Zhao Zilong that they went in formation and went into a frontal attack, and yelled at his men to follow him. He ordered Zhang Fei to flank them, and Zhang Fei understood. Guan Yu also told Gao Fei Hu and Gao Fei Bao to flank them. They agreed and yelled that they should call them soldiers of heaven because they were the heavenly soldiers summoned by the gods. Their men yelled at each other to shake them up and tear them apart, while others yelled at them to attack and kill them all. Kin Man ordered his men to stop the bombing as Zhao Zilong, and the others were coming. Cheng Dalei leaped and asked Kin Man what he was waiting for. He yelled at him to open the gates and take the initiative with him. The soldiers went puzzled as the gate opened, and shadows of people came attacking. They warned others to be careful because Cheng Dalei was coming for them, while others realized something was wrong because they were being sandwiched from the front and back. Cheng Dalei told Hart that they were going to play BGM, and Hart understood and told him to give them a funeral with the sound of the death bell. She informed him that the conditions were fulfilled, and he could now choose the battle song with the chorus from all sides. Hart released musical notes, and notes began to float. Hart played music, and a system notification popped up stating that the BGM chorus from all sides was playing, and a voice described that even the King of Western Chu was crushed by it. Hart closed her eyes as she continued. Cheng Dale stated that they would also be the same and called them bleeders. The soldiers panicked, mumbling that it was all over because they were attacked from both sides, believing that they were dead, while others claimed that gods were standing behind them because they could summon heavenly soldiers and use the powers of others. The enemy fighting spirit was reduced by 20% during the war song, while fear, timidity, panic, and other negative emotions increased by 20%. The soldiers, on the other hand, wondered how they could be an enemy of the gods, while some screamed for their mothers as they died. Troops in landslide defeat, yelling at each other to flee quickly, questioning why they were still standing and not running for their lives because if they didn't, the enemy's swords would turn them all into ghosts. The soldiers yelled at others to retreat, while Lieutenant Zhu wondered what was happening given that they had 10,000 allied troops, and the man beside him responded that the momentum had gone, and they should get out there. Lieutenant Zhu thought that 18 village chiefs had joined forces to fight an island of a thousand men and thought it would be a piece of cake, but in the blink of an eye, the attacker and defender had switched roles, and he was reduced to a grieving dog, wondering how it happened. He wondered why, and if it has anything to do with Cheng Dalei. However, he rejected the thought, thinking that even if he was strong, he was still just a martial artist. His men told him to get out fast, and he told them to wait. Lieutenant Zhu realized who it was and that the legend said that Cheng Dalei's actions were directed by him. 
He blamed Zhu Shenji for planning all of it as he stood alone on a high platform, looking down on everything. And from his perspective, he wondered how there could be such a man who used his troops like a god in the world. Rumor had it that 18 lieutenants allied with the army of 10,000 attacked the Snake Island, which was later renamed to Toad Island. And when they attacked, they encountered a mountain of fog, thunder and clear skies, and a mysterious army from heaven. And more than half of the 10,000 allied soldiers were killed or wounded, and thousands of soldiers were taken prisoner, and even the leaders of many villages died in the battle. A notification appeared stating that the mission to defend the village ten times had already completed two of the ten current missions. And after the battle, the forces of the Qin River knew that Cheng Dale had come to Toad Island, and he had Zhu Shenji by his side. A voice instructed everyone to form a line one by one properly. Liu Bei assured the people that they would surely walk the talk, and anyone who contributed would be rewarded. He told them to come to receive their reward. Moments later, he handed the man his money and said that one person only got one string of money and told them to get on board after receiving the money, assuring them that they would bring them all back. The man asked Zhu Shenji if the allied armies they were all confronted with that day were Mo Mingmi's men, and Zhu Shenji agreed, informing him that the Toad Village had come to Kinchuan Mountain Pass to simply settle down and set up a stronghold. He went on to say that Mo Mingmi was unable to tolerate having them, so they kept sending people to attack, and Liu Bai asked the man what he wanted by asking them about it. The man mentioned Mo Mingmi's name with all seriousness. He informed them that a year ago, Mo Mingmi sent someone to kidnap his two sons, and he didn't get caught with them because he managed to hide away. He went on to say that he had no news about his sons in the past year and assumed they were dead, and that now he was the only one left alone. He asked Zhu Shenji if the Toad Village was recruiting people because he wanted to join them, and only would he be able to seek revenge on Mo Mingmi. The crowd shared their experiences, as one of their fathers and second uncles, as well as someone's daughter-in-law and the other their daughter, were kidnapped by them, while others had their dogs from their home cooked by Mo Mingmi's subordinates. Someone else said that their house's Zio King died so miserably, while others said that Mo Mingmi and them couldn't live under the same sky and asked Zhu Shenji if he could join the Toad Village, where others also felt the same. Zhu Shenji assured them that Toad Village was protecting the area's safety, and that no one would ever hurt them again, and Liu Bei joined in and told those who wanted to join the Toad Village to stand on his side. He told them that in the future they would all eat meat and drink liquor and go through thick and thin together, and a system notification appeared, stating that newcomers had joined the village, adding 380 to Mountain Village's population. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale assured the prisoners that there was no need for them to be afraid, and that whether two armies confronted him, and whether they won or lost, they had nothing to do with it, and that he would not kill them all because he had no ill will towards them. He told them they could ask around if they ever bullied the old and weak people or robbed any poor household since they arrived, assuring them that Toad Village does not provoke or stir up trouble, and informing them about Mo Mingmi, who still couldn't stand having them and sent troops to annihilate them. If they wanted to blame someone, they should blame Mo Mingmi. He went on to say that even though they were all captured, he would not kill them, but he couldn't take care of them all. That's why he told those who wanted to stay and join them that once they became brothers, they would all go through thick and thin together. Cheng Dale told them it was okay if they wanted to leave, that they would pay their travel fees and bring them all home. A man asked him if he would really set them free. Cheng Dale agreed, as his words weighed as much as nine tripods. He hoped that after they went back, they would all be able to help him pass his words to Mo Mingmi, and that he would settle down and just do business and earn money, and that they didn't have any other motive and that they would understand. He went on to say something about Mo Mingmi's insistence on becoming his enemy. He informed them that he would not be staying still. The men assured Cheng Dale that they would make sure that his words were delivered. Cheng Dale directed his men to see their visitors out. Lai Zinzai doubted, claiming that Cheng Dale's method did not work because all the prisoners left. Lai Zinzai stated that having two out of ten people stay back was not a bad thing, and that most of them left after receiving the money, and Cheng Dale responded that he didn't get anything at all, and that even if none of them stayed back, the deal would still be favorable to them. Lai Zinzai asked rhetorically if he was just returning the tiger to the mountains after releasing all of them, believing that Mo Mingmi would simply send them back to attack him. Cheng Dale inquired of Lai Zinzai whether he was supposed to kill them if he did not release them. Lai Zinzai asked Cheng Dale why he spent money on them but gained nothing, and Cheng Dale replied that he wanted to gain a reputation. When Lai Zinzai asked if he still cared about his reputation, Cheng Dale told him that it was a good thing that was sometimes easy to control. 
Cheng Dale explained that the more people who left, the wider the incident would spread, and by the time everyone knew, those who were captured by Toad Village would not only be killed, but they would also be given money to travel back home. He imagined a soldier saying that it was better to lose fighting Toad Village because there was no need to put in any effort, and they could still earn money. He asked Lai Zinzai if those people would still risk their lives the next time they were ordered to attack Toad Village because being a soldier was also just to earn money. Lai Zinzai said nothing. He chuckled as he suddenly found it interesting. As the prisoners left, Cheng Dale's name was already on everyone's lips at the Kin River, and it would take a long time for the incident's aftermath to settle down, and a system notification popped up stating that fear points increased. The 18 forces lost many people, and several leaders also died in battle, and immediately everyone took the time to discuss Cheng Dale. While the 18 lieutenants no longer had the strength, nor did they want to mess with Cheng Dale, the Toad Village ushered in a period of peaceful development. Cheng Dale hummed, thinking that his fame had finally spread, and he made a lot of fear points with his current fear points of 6,106,432. He believed it was time to begin planning for an upgrade to a level 3 village, as information about Toad's village's current population of 3,568 popped up, and the population prerequisites for a tertiary village were 5,000. He mumbled that money was useless and life was faded, and he noticed that the summoning platform was also open, allowing him to summon a wave of characters. As he tapped on the system, he stated the incompetent disperses, and the emperor possessed as he summoned 100 draws. A system notification popped stating that the summoning platform had activated. Another appeared and informed him that he had 1 million fear points deducted, and Hart informed him that she had received his request. Hart chanted that the awakening of the emotions of the whole earth would herald the light of the stars. She went on to say that the emotions of the world are stirred, and the great men of the world were gathered, as stars began to shine. She summoned countless stars, light began to travel and swoosh. A system notification appeared, stating that he had obtained an ordinary rogue, an ordinary blacksmith, a bad mason, and so on. The system informed him that a total of 100 bad to excellent characters were awarded, which made Cheng Dale disappointed that nothing good was drawn. He tapped the system, thinking he had more than 5 million to go in another 100 draws, as the system deducted another 1 million fear points from him. Hart began summoning once more, and a notification popped up stating that he had obtained a normal farmer, a bad mason, an excellent fisherman, a normal scholar, and so on. The system informed him once more that a total of 100 bad to excellent characters had been awarded, prompting him to wonder why there was nothing good again. Cheng Dale was taken aback and asked for another million to be drawn, and the system deducted another million. A system information popped stating that he had obtained a hundred characters. It went on for a little while longer, with the system informing him of what he had obtained, until a total of 5 million fear points were drawn, and a total of 500 characters came out. Cheng Dale cursed as he realized he only has 1,106,432 fear points left. He asked to draw 10 more times, claiming that he would keep 10,000 fear points for emergencies and that the last 100,000 were the last time and that if he did it again, he would be a dog. Hart deducted another 100,000 fear points. She began to summon, and as he lifted her hand, a light appeared. A system notification popped, stating that he obtained a normal merchant, a bad tailor, a bad carter, and so on. Then lastly, a system notification appeared, stating that he obtained a top warrior. Cheng Dale was excited that something good had appeared. Hart congratulated him on getting the top warrior fan Lihua. A system mission appeared, stating that an exclusive task for top characters had been triggered. And as for phase 1, he should defeat Fan Lihua with any character, including the host himself, or otherwise, he could take her in by any means. Cheng Dale was curious if there would be a follow-up mission after defeating her in Phase 1. He reasoned that this time he ordered a total of 510 people, which was still about 900 less than the requirements for a level 3 village, and that now that the village was also firmly established at the Qin River, it was time for Su Ying and Liu Jihan to arrive. He realized that he had not seen them in months and expressed that he missed them quite a bit, when suddenly Gao Feibao appeared and called him out. Gao Feibao informed him that a lot of people had appeared in front of the village, stating they wanted to join their village. Cheng Dale was puzzled at how fast it was. He informed Gao Feibao that he had an extremely important task for him and asked if he could also get Zhu Shenji because he had a task for him as well. 
and Gao Feibao agreed. Over the next 10 days, group after group of people came to join, and a voice ordered everyone to get in line, telling them that they had traveled a long distance, and, fittingly, stating that they were short on staff at Toad Village. Zhu Shenji told them to come and sign up as they were all brothers from on. Meanwhile, Gao Feibao rushed to the south of the river with Cheng Dali's letters. Meanwhile, at Kinchuan Mountain, a man overlooked as carriages began entering the gates. Mo Mingmi asked if they were satisfied with the goods. A man informed him that they were satisfied, and Jin Wendao had requested an additional 10,000 swords and shields. Because he ordered so many, Mo Mingmi referred to him as a hungry wolf. Mo Mingmi believed that Jin Wendao was bound to succeed to the throne because he wanted so many iron ore weapons. The man informed him that the Ring tribe had left, and the city's elite soldiers had nothing to worry about now, asking Mo Mingmi if they should start preparing to attack Cheng Dale. Mo Mingmi warned him not to rush, as Cheng Dale defeated 18 lieutenants and 10,000 allied troops in one day, and he was neither defender nor repelled but rather crushed their troops, leaving him wondering if he really only had 2,000 people. The man stated that according to the people who were released, there were only 2,000 people in Toad Village, which made Mo Mingmi wonder how they lost. Mo Mingmi also heard that on that morning, the sky was clear and sunny, and a miasma sealed the mountain, making no one be seen within 10 feet. The man went on to say that on that day, they saw a lot of people on the city walls in the fog, and it wasn't until after the battle that they realized most of them were scarecrows. He also said that before the big battle, the city walls seemed to have a thousand armies shouting to kill, and while attacking the city, four groups of ambushers suddenly appeared from the rear, making the army in turmoil, which wrapped it up. Mo Mingmi called them a bunch of losers for such an obvious ambush plan that none of them could see and the man responded that an unimaginable thick fog suddenly appeared, and rumor had it that immortals were around helping Cheng Dale. Mo Mingmi questioned it, calling it a joke, and claimed that they had mastered some weather observation tricks with some luck, and told the man to pass on his order to attack tomorrow immediately, and the man retorted that he was being impatient, claiming that they could easily fall into the enemy's evil plot. The man told him about the strategist behind Cheng Dale, Zhu Shenji, was a powerful man to be careful of, and that he was the one who planned the destruction of the 100,000 Ring tribe men, the rebellion in the capital, and the assassination of the Ring's king. Mo Mingmi asked his military advisor what they should do about Cheng Dale and the Toad Village, wondering if they should just leave them alone. The military advisor stated that they couldn't let others sleep peacefully on the side of the bed but he couldn't figure out what Zhu Shenji's plan was, claiming that it was not the time to attack. He also told Mo Mingmi that the Toad Village was recruiting recently, suggesting that they send someone to infiltrate and find out what was going on. He suggested that it would be better if they could find a chance to assassinate Zhu Shenji or Cheng Dale. Mo Mingmi agreed, saying that while they could kill Cheng Dale, they couldn't kill Zhu Shenji if he was as good as he said, and ordered him not to hurt him, believing that he might still have some use, and the military advisor agreed. Meanwhile, in a jail cell, on the ground were a plate of fish bones. Yun Zhonglong slept on the ground beside his finished meal. Loud footsteps were approaching. A voice greeted Yun Zhonglong. Cheng Dale told him that life was good as he watched him gain weight, which made Yun Zhonglong excited about Cheng Dale's visit. Yun Zhonglong blushed as he asked when he would let him go because he was his man now, and Cheng Dale was perplexed because he was not like that. Cheng Dale asked if they would still listen to him or recognize him as their leader if he returned after being imprisoned for more than half a month, and Yun Zhonglong assured him that if he let him go, those gangsters would be subdued. Yun Zhonglong informed him that whoever dared to take his seat would be chopped up because his seat was not just for anyone. Cheng Dale felt relieved and told him he would send him back, but first, he had to tell him if he got any information about Mo Mingmi. He also told him to put on a play to deceive them because his mountain village still needed a ransom ready to hand over to his people, which Yun Zhonglong understood. Cheng Dale told him that he was counting on him to infiltrate the enemy, and Yun Zhonglong assured him that he should not be worried. After a while, a voice told Cheng Dale to be honest and hand them over the money and the people. Cheng Dale advised them not to get any bad ideas as they were still in their Toad Village territory. After a while, Yun Zhonglong threatened Cheng Dale, telling him to be good and wash his neck before waiting for him to kill him, while the soldiers held him back and asked him to calm down. The soldiers yelled at each other that they went back quickly. Cheng Dale claimed that Yun Zhonglong was good at acting, 
Kin Man asked if he wasn't afraid Yun Zhonglong was just pretending to surrender and would take advantage of the opportunity to get out. Cheng Dalei responded that it was of no use to lock him up, and they also demanded a ransom because it cost food to keep him for nothing. He believed it would be better to let him go, and if he truly brought him useful information, which was blood money. He told Kin Man that they went back to the village. Moments later, a huge group of people gathered outside, making Cheng Dale wonder. He was perplexed as to how so many people came to join them after so many days passed. He told Kin Man they went to have a look. A voice inquired about the person's name. A man named Zhang Kang responded, and Su Shenji inquired about what he did. Zhang Kang responded, saying that he was a blacksmith back in his village. Cheng Dale was curious about Zhang Kang and viewed his information. Zhang Kang's true name was revealed to be Mu Chengzheng, a 32-year-old unknown top scout with the ability to infiltrate, spy, and disguise, which surprised Cheng Dale, who wondered why a top scout was pretending to be a blacksmith, and why he said his surname was Zhang. He finally concluded that he was a spy. Cheng Dale interviewed Zhang Kang on why he wanted to join Toad Village. Zhang Kang informed them that his family was hit by a natural disaster, and his parents died, and he had no place to go, so he came to join them. Cheng Dale inquired about the location of his home and the type of the disaster. Zhang Kang responded that his family was in Bingzhu, where they were hit by a locust plague, and Cheng Dale asked if he had any family members at home whom he could bring along, which made Zhang Kang wonder if Cheng Dale was suspecting him and why he was being asked so many questions while others were only asked a few. Zhang Kang explained that his parents were dead and he had no place to go, so he came to join them on purpose. Cheng Dale sighed. Cheng Dale inquired of Zhu Shenji about his thoughts on Zhang Kang, and Zhu Shenji replied that he was a great guy and that their village blacksmith shop needed manpower. Cheng Dale chuckled and told Zhang Kang that they're all brothers from now on since he came to Toad Village. He also told him not to address him as grandpa, but rather as the village master, and Zhang Kang agreed. Zhang Kang smirked, thinking that his time spent making up backgrounds, origins, and other excuses had not been in vain and claiming that what he had heard about Cheng Dale obeying Zhu Shenji seemed to be true. Cheng Dale ordered his men to take Zhang Kang to the blacksmith shop to familiarize himself. He informed Zhu Shenji that something was wrong with Zhang Kang, stating that he would be responsible for watching him and ordering him to stay with him at night, which made Zhu Shenji wonder why he would arrange for him to live with himself. Cheng Dale explained that it was because he was the strategist, and he felt relieved with him while keeping an eye on him. Zhu Shenji smiled, stating that Cheng Dale was right and assuring him not to worry because with him, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Cheng Dale felt that he was careless. He thought that people came to the Toad Village every day, and among them was a spy looking for information, prompting him to believe that it should be properly investigated. After a while, a voice prompted their new brothers to come. Cheng Dale told them that he would personally test them as he viewed for their information. A man inquired if they needed to take a test to become a mountain bandit. Cheng Dale stated that everyone should be assessed and those who were good at fishing should go fishing, while those who were good at smithing should go blacksmithing because everyone had their own duty. He assigned someone to go fishing while questioning the other about why he wanted to go smithing while claiming to be a scholar and informing them that those who did not obey the transfer would not be admitted. Through a day's investigation, Cheng Dale found more than a dozen problematic people. Cheng Dale reasoned that he was going to throw a dozen people into the blacksmith shop to forge, not knowing if they were there for assassination, spying, or just messing around when they came in. He thought that the workers knocking on their door should not be wasted, and if he gave them eight hours to forge a day, he didn't think they'd have the energy to stir up trouble. Cheng Dale chuckled. Suddenly, Gao Fei who came informing him of bad news that someone was coming to attack their mountain village. Cheng Dale told him to calm down and asked who had the guts to attack them, teaching him to have a general's demeanor, and to remain calm and composed in the face of difficulties. Gao Fei who went on to say that there was a female general outside with the surname Fan. Cheng Dale stood up, realizing that the female general with the surname Fan had to be her, and asked him if she had come. He quickly ran with excitement. Gao Fei who said nothing as he observed Cheng Dale run hastily. He remembered what Cheng Dale said about having the demeanor of a general. Gao Fei who had not yet finished informing him that she had mentioned his name to beat him up. Meanwhile, at the dock in Toad Village, a stranger approached the group and asked why they didn't move out of the way because the fight was over. The stranger told them she was looking for Cheng Dale, and Kin Man told her that they wouldn't let her meet him because she came with murderous intent and didn't explain why. Fan Li Hu unsheathed her sword as she rode her horse. She scoffed and told them not to blame her for not being polite. 
A voice called out for Fan Lihua. He asked where Fan Lihua was. Kin Man and the others realized that it was Cheng Dale, and Fan Lihua asked him if he was Cheng Dale. She stated that she heard of his excellent martial arts while on his way to the grasslands to assassinate the Ring Tribe King and defeat various heroes. She stated that she enjoyed sparring with experts, so she came to learn a few things. In addition, information appeared describing Fan Lihua, a 26-year-old woman with pear blossom sword skills and a hidden talent for unrivaled horsemanship. Cheng Dale asked her rhetorically if it was a good idea to fight and kill because it was their first meeting, and he couldn't do that to such a beautiful girl like her. Fan Lihua, on the other hand, retorted that if he did not accept, she would come to his mountain gate every day. And if he was a dignified leader of Toad Village, she rhetorically asked him if he would want to be a coward. Cheng Dale was taken aback when he realized Fan Lihua's side mission was quite difficult. Despite the fact that he claimed she was a masculine woman, he requested that Kin Man try her skill for him. But Kin Man informed him that he already did so. He inquired as to what happened, and Kin Man shamelessly stated that he lost. Cheng Dale inquired as to how he lost, and Kin Man replied that he fell off the horse, asking Cheng Dale not to inquire further details because he felt humiliated. Cheng Dale was depressed because he believed Kin Man had lost miserably, which caused him not to be willing to mention it. Doubting whether Fan Lihua could really knock Kin Man off his horse or if he had lost intentionally, he asked the others who could help him. He inquired about Zhao Zhilong, and he responded that he would never fight women. Cheng Dale looked perplexed, thinking as if his senior sister were not a woman. He asked Guan Yu if he thought Fan Lihua was just selling her life despite the fact that the winner had already been decided. However, Guan Yu disagreed because he believed that children and women were difficult to raise, and he disdained fighting women. Cheng Dale wondered how they could concede today, as he assumed it was because they were afraid of losing to a girl, and were deliberately making excuses. He asked Zhang Fei, who said nothing. Zhang Fei jumped on the horse and assured Cheng Dale to leave it to him. Zhang Fei cursed Fan Lihua and told her to come fight him as he charged. Fan Lihua repositioned herself in response to Zhang Fei's attack. The two began their battle, while the group observed from a distance. Kin Man mentioned Zhang Fei as interesting, and Guan Yu added that Zhang Fei fought to give their toad village some face. Moments later, Zhang Fei was defeated. Humiliation was felt from Cheng Dale's party. Fan Li Hua told Cheng Dale that if he wanted to defeat her with just a few bandits like him, he would be next. While a system notification popped up, stating that Fan Li Hua's hidden attribute, unrivaled horsemanship, was upgraded by one level. Cheng Dale stated to let him learn her skills, but before that, he had a condition before they fought. Fan Li Hua inquired what the condition was. Cheng Dale explained to her that if he won, he wanted her to work for him because he hoped she would join his toad village. He informed her that her monthly salary would be 500 tails of silver. Fan Lihua, irritated, inquired about what he said and whether he flirted with her while calling him a pervert. Zhang Fei chimed in, saying that he should help them in taking revenge and teaching her a lesson, and Cheng Dale agreed, assuring them that he would fight her personally. Kin Man informed him that he bought a horse for him, but Cheng Dale scoffed, asking if he still needed to ride a horse to fight a girl. Fan Lihua inquired if he was looking down on her for wanting to fight her without a horse. Cheng Dale reasoned that her physical body was in poor condition and that he would not take advantage of her for the sake of fairness, so he told her that she was free to come after him. As they charged at each other, Fan Lihua remarked that he was too arrogant and should eat her sword. Cheng Dale warned her to be careful. As they prompted each other to come, the two began to fight. Cheng Dale thought that he would better try her unrivaled horsemanship skill. Fan Lihua unleashed her Peer Blossom Slash skill, which connected to Cheng Dale's sword. Cheng Dale struggled as he thought that her sword had strong power, believing that her swordsmanship was a flower-type sword martial art, which was light, fast, clever, and chaotic. He also mentioned that when combined with the force of the horse's charge, her stance became fast. Cheng Dale rolled to the ground. As he grabbed the dirt, he thought about how Kin Man was knocked off his horse in a few moves by Fan Lihua. He claimed that Fan Lihua was worthy of unrivaled horsemanship. Fan Lihua mentioned the legend of Cheng Dale, who swept through the grasslands, even scaring the Ring tribe. She went on to mock him that he couldn't even stand her sword, and expressed her disappointment towards him. Zhang Fei commented that Cheng Dale was truly something a brother who should be disgraced or beaten by a woman together, while announcing his loss, which irritated Cheng Dale, who stated that he only lost by one slash and had not even gotten serious yet. He scoffed at them. Cheng Dale asked Fan Lihua to come to him, and she agreed. 
The two restarted their fight and began to charge at each other. Fan Lihua released her Pure Blossom Thrust skill, however, Cheng Dale dodged it with ease. She unleashed her next skill, the Pure Blossom Floating Cut, which resulted in the same result where Cheng Dale dodged it because he didn't think he could fight her recklessly. He claimed that Fan Lihua's sword was ruthless, wondering if she wanted to kill him, and if that was the case, he couldn't hold back. He called out to Hart, asking her to possess him, and a system notification popped up, deducting him 100 fear points. Fan Li Hua struggled to block Cheng Dale's colorless double wing phoenix skill and Alfei's fast sword exploding fireworks. As she deflected countless Cheng Dale's attacks, she thought of it as a handsome lightness skill and wondered if it was his true strength. She also realized that his strength was not that strong, despite how fast this sword was. She thought that his lightness skill was difficult to deal with, and the most annoying was his jumping fighting style, and if she were entangled, she believed that she would not be able to develop the momentum for cavalry long-range attack. Cheng Dale smiled as he realized that he got her. Then suddenly Fan Li Hua swung her sword. Fan Li Hua released her Pier Blossom floating cut skill and told Cheng Dale to eat it as their swords connected. She was perplexed because it didn't cut him while an image of Cheng Dale vanished in front of her. Fan Li Hua realized that it was his shadow. Fan Li Hua noticed Cheng Dale leaping behind her. She quickly turned around. She held the hilt of her sword tightly as she rotated and told Cheng Dale to die. Cheng Dale suddenly grabbed her wrist, catching her. Surprised, Fan Li Hua gritted her teeth. Cheng Dale asked her if she tried to kill someone. While addressing her name, he grabbed both of her wrists. Fan Li Hua struggled and cursed at him, demanding him to let go. Cheng Dale complimented her, stating that she had good horsemanship. However, Fan Li Hua screamed at him to let go. Cheng Dale dragged her off her horse, which made her scream about it. They both fell as Cheng Dale clung to her. Worried, Kin Man and the others called out for Cheng Dale. They realized Cheng Dale fell into the river, claiming that there were poisonous snakes in it. Fan Li Hua and Cheng Dale emerged from the sea, accompanied by the body of a snake. Cheng Dale realized it wasn't good because there were snakes in the water. As Fan Li Hua struggled, pleading with Cheng Dale to release her, Cheng Dale reasoned that, while the snakes would not attack the people of Toad Village, she was not yet a member. Cheng Dale warned her not to move because snakes were in the water. Fan Li Hua misinterpreted what Cheng Dale said about sleeping and showing some colors, and she wondered if he intended to take her there, claiming that he turned out to be a shameless pervert. She decided to overpower Cheng Dale and insulted him. She punched him while telling him to eat her fist, causing Cheng Dale to groan. Struggling, Cheng Dale asked what she was doing as snakes surrounded them. He begged for her to wait as the snakes approached them slowly. Cheng Dale groaned while realizing that the snakes were coming. The snakes hissed and opened their fangs. Cheng Dale grabbed his sword asking Fan Li Hua to wait. Fan Li Hua ignored him as she unleashed her pear flower hammer skill and told him to die, causing Cheng Dale to curse. Water splashed around Fan Li Hua as she continuously attacked him. Her fists made an explosive noise while causing water to splash everywhere. The water made a little wave reaching to the docks. Exhausted, Fan Li Hua breathed heavily as she beat up Cheng Dale. She gritted her teeth as she was about to punch him again. Fan Li Hua noticed and wondered that Cheng Dale still had his sword. She reasoned that if she hadn't knocked him unconscious, she would have died. Fan Li Hua's eyes widened and realized something. The bodies of snakes were floating in the water. It occurred to her as she observed her surroundings. She was curious if Cheng Dale had killed the snakes. Fan Li Hua claimed that she had not noticed him holding his sword earlier, leading her to believe that if he truly desired her life, she would have died. She wondered if Cheng Dale had been trying to save her even though she was beating him. Fan Li Hua's eyes widened. Cheng Dale, bruised and battered, asked her what was wrong with her. Fan Li Hua said nothing as she sweated in embarrassment. Tin Man and the others arrived asking Cheng Dale if he had won. Fan Li Hua quickly dashed, making Kin Man and the others wonder why. Kin Man approached Cheng Dale and asked how he was, and Cheng Dale replied that he was fine. He was skeptical, stating that given how badly his face had been beaten, he wondered how he could be fine. Whereas Cheng Dale sighed, claiming that Fan Li Hua had not held back. Kin Man asked if they were going to let Fan Li Hua go in such a way. Cheng Dale said nothing, as he just thought that his future general was fierce. He claimed that she was just like an untamed warhorse. Cheng Dale shouted and called Fan Li Hua. He asked how they should return her horse and blade to her. Fan Li Hua was still blushing as she looked back. She placed her hand over her mouth as if about to whistle. Then she started whistling, and footsteps were heard near the dock. The horse neighed loudly and leaped towards the water. After leaping, the horse made a splash in the water. 
The horse swam towards Fan Lihua. Cheng Dale yelled, pleading with Fan Lihua not to run and to at least leave him a contact number. A voice told Cheng Dale to stop shouting as Fan Lihua was too far away. Jiang Fei stated that Fan Lihua's horse was totally compatible with her, and Cheng Dale responded that it was more accurate to say that her horseback riding skills were unrivaled under the heavens. Cheng Dale directed Kin Man to have some people investigate Fan Lihua's background. Kin Man asked him if he took a liking to her, and Cheng Dale retorted that he just wanted to know why someone like her would run all the way to their village. He told him to go and investigate Fan Lihua's origins for him. Many days later, Cheng Dale was called out by someone informing him of the information they collected on Fan Lihua. Kin Man stated that Fan Lihua was the current head of the descending Jade Village, who kept a low profile until recently when Fan Lihua began going around challenging the experts of the Jianghu. He went on to say that in the span of two months, Fan Lihua defeated over 10 experts, and Fan Lihua was undefeated on her warhorse. However, he believed that the losers didn't say anything because they were embarrassed to lose to a girl who still remained unknown. Cheng Dale asked Kin Man why she went around challenging everyone, and Kin Man responded that no one knew because she didn't say anything, and that it was because she wanted to challenge experts. But that wasn't enough of a reason. Cheng Dale was under the impression that it was complicated to recruit a high-level character. He believed that he should not rush to get peak-level characters because they would not listen to him if he got them, leading him to believe that if he obtained a Lu Bu-level general, he might be killed before he could recruit them. He asked Kin Man where Fan Lihua would be heading next, and Kin Man replied that even though she changed locations every day, he believed she was still in the Kin region. Cheng Dale directed him to continue his investigation into Fan Lihua, and to report back to him immediately if there was anything new, and Kin Man agreed. After a while, Cheng Dale eventually lay down on the couch. Cheng Dale snored while he was sleeping. Princess Minju opened the door, calling out for Cheng Dale and telling him she had a few questions that she wanted to ask him as she had read all the books he had given her. She called out for him while being confused. Princess Minju wondered if he was asleep. She leaned closer, noticing that he was hurt again. She felt worried as she mumbled something. She went on to say that Cheng Dale only knew how to fight and kill every day, despite how many injuries he had. She said nothing and kissed him. As the papers on the table began to rustle from the wind, Princess Minju continued to kiss him. Some of the papers flew as a kissing sound continued. Rain began to fall down outside the house. Cheng Dale groaned and touched his lips. He claimed why his face and lips were a little wet. He wondered if there was another leak in the roof. Meanwhile, at the Toad Village, Iron Smithing Zone, Su Shenji yelled at everyone to do their best because their job as an ironsmith could decide the fate of Toad Village, and he reminded them of their motto and he recited their motto, which was to work hard, do their best, and put everything they have into their work. And the more they smelled as they struck the iron and wiped their sweat, the stronger their bodies would become, as they worked all day and all night. And if the work was not done, they would not rest. And if the Toad Village wasn't number one, they would try to do their best. And he told them what the short term was. He continued stating that they have to work really hard, as the men continuously hammered the iron. Later, at 12 p.m., that midnight, he thanked everyone for their hard work and reminded them that he would see them again at 7 a.m. Exhausted, Mu Changjin complained about having to smelt iron for 16 hours a day, and that being a mountain bandit was harder than he imagined. He also realized that he didn't have time to investigate the place. He stated that even if he was given the opportunity to kill Cheng Dale, he lacked the strength to raise his blade, wondering if his cover was blown and if this was why they were putting him to such a hellish work schedule. He realized that the others were also working on the same schedule as him. Mu Changjeng sighed, claiming that he couldn't blame anyone else as it was his fault for disguising himself as an ironsmith. In reality, all the people there were spies detected by Cheng Dale. A voice yelled that dinner has been served and told everyone to get their fill, and that there was more than enough for them. Mu Changjeng smiled as he thought that a meal after a hard day of work was a blessing. He further thought that he could have as much meat and rice as he wanted, believing that if his identity was truly exposed, they would not be feeding them good food, and laughed as he mumbled that a meal tastes best after a hard day's work. After eating, they gave them their own bed pillows to sleep on. Mu Changjeng fell asleep the moment his head touched the pillow. Mu Changjeng was about to fall asleep when he wondered why he was there and decided to forget it. Time flew by and a month has passed. The cold wind signaled the arrival of autumn. A voice inside the carriage addressed Su Ying. It asked her how long until they could meet Cheng Dale again. Su Ying stated that it wouldn't be long. She peered through the curtain, convinced that they were already in the Kin region. 
A voice spoke up about the replacement of many dynasties. Cheng Dalei believed that most of the fallen dynasties were marked by messy coincidences, natural disasters, foreign enemies, plagues, and peasant uprisings. He claimed that once the fire started to burn, countless sparks would scatter and ignite more land. Princess Minju asked if there was a way to change the situation. He stated that it would be hard to say because when each dynasty was established, it improved the system of the previous dynasty. He also stated that no matter what system, there was no perfect fit for any era, only constant trial and error, and continuous improvement. Cheng Dalei went on to say that when a dynasty's problems accumulated, a class contradiction might happen at any time, and a key figure would appear, and a gentle push would result in a dynasty collapsing. This made Princess Minju wonder what he meant by a key figure. Cheng Dale rhetorically asked how they could rebuild everything if they were to start over. He stated that that's what he thought as Cheng Dale stated, whereas Princess Minju said nothing. And suddenly Gao Fei Hu appeared, stating that he had something to report to Cheng Dale. Gao Fei Hu informed him that Su Ying's caravan had already entered Kinchuan Mountain, believing that they would arrive at the Toad Village within a day. Cheng Dale inquired whether he had sent someone to meet with them, and Gao Fei Hu replied that Zhao Zilong had already led someone to pick them up. He reasoned that if they had entered Kinchuan Pass, it would be Mo Mingmi's territory, and if Mo Mingmi found out, they would be a problem because there were so many people who were too conspicuous. He assumed Zhao Zilong had already brought people to go with him, which relieved him because he was so strong and reliable and there shouldn't be any problems. Cheng Dale's face darkened as he questioned his thoughts. He realized he had become careless, wondering how he could have allowed Zhao Zilong to pick up Su Ying. In his mind, a scenario played out in which Zhao Zilong, like the romance in Three Kingdoms, caused Madame Mai and Sio Ying to jump into a well. Anxious, Cheng Dale yelled and stated that he had to pick up Su Ying himself. He told Gao Fei Hu to prepare a horse for him because Su Ying was coming soon and he wanted to meet her, but Gao Fei asked if he was going alone, and if he wanted to bring some brothers with him. Cheng Dale told him that there was no need. Princess Minju said nothing as she observed. She closed the book she was reading. She breathed out a heavy breath, causing her to curse at Cheng Dale. After a while, Cheng Dale rode as fast as he could on a horse. Cheng Dale sang excitedly, addressing Su Ying's name and stating that he would be coming. Flushed with success, a horse's hoof disease were. The wind swooshed as they run. The horse were suddenly tripped by a rope, making the horse lose its balance. Cheng Dale cursed as he too were sent flying. Cheng Dale regained his footing and called upon those who dared to attack him. A voice behind him stated its presence. Cheng Dale turned around as he realized the voice came through the back. Fan Lihua asked what he was looking at as she trapped him. She covered his mouth with a handkerchief which made Cheng Dale moan. Cheng Dale realized that handkerchief was drugged. He began to fight back and powered through Fan Lihua. Both of their swords clash. Fan Lihua addressed Cheng Dale's name, whereas Cheng Dale began to cough aggressively. She questioned him that she heard he looked for her and asked if he expected them to meet again so soon. Cheng Dale responded by stating he thought it would be someone else, but it turned out to be just her, and that she didn't know any martial ethics from carrying out a sneak attack. He felt bad and went on to say that her wishful thinking would be wrong. Cheng Dale's vision blurred as a few silhouettes appeared. He struggled and mumbled that he had a cheat. However, he stuttered as he asked heart to possess. Cheng Dale were perplexed, and Fan Li Hua approached him, saying she had not expected him to fall into her hands. The system informed him that his current fear points accumulated over the past month were 934,321, and Heart warned him not to rely too much on the system's possession, leaving Cheng Dale perplexed. He noticed he didn't have any fear points, while Fan Li Hua ordered her people to tie him up and take him away. The handkerchief Fan Lihua used earlier flew away. Heart hummed as she observed what was happening below. She stated that the only way to trigger Fan Lihua's special mission was to be kidnapped. A message appears stating that activating Fan Lihua's third phase mission had been checked with the content that he fell into descending Jade Village and was wounded by the Pear Blossom Sword. A voice greeted a madam, while others welcomed their brothers, saying they traveled a long way and must be exhausted, and telling them to get on the boat and they would take them back to the island, while others told others to load the goods first, and someone told them to line up, and someone went on to tell the others that the madam brought hundreds of talents, artisans, carpenters, scholars, and bookkeepers, which relieved the others because their village needed more manpower, and on the other hand, someone recognized Xu Yu. Liu Zhihan called out to Cheng Dale asking where he was. Zhu Shenji appeared and felt relieved at Su Ying's arrival and told her that they didn't have to be separated from Cheng Dale anymore, 
whereas Su Ying greeted him as they have not seen each other for a long time. Liu Jiehan frowned and inquired as to where Cheng Dalei was, and Su Ying responded by asking Zhu Shenji the same question and inquiring as to where Cheng Dalei was, stating that she already arrived and asking why he wasn't there to pick her up. Zhu Shenji was perplexed and wondered if they were picked up by Cheng Dalei. He told them that he should have been with them for more than two hours, and Su Ying replied that they didn't see him along the way. Kin Man arrived, calling out to Zhu Shenji, and informed him that Cheng Dalei's horse had returned on its own. Zhu Shenji got confused and inquired if it was truly Cheng Dalei's horse. Kin Man agreed and stated that the horse's front hooves were injured, asking him to look at the marks and believing that the horse had fallen from a tripwire along the way. Concerned, Liu Jihan screamed Cheng Dalei's name, prompting Su Ying to inquire if he had been attacked on his way to pick them up, and led Zhu Shenji to speculate if Mo Mingmi had set a trap to capture Cheng Dalei. Kin Man stated that it would be possible. However, with Cheng Dalei's strength, he believed that he would not be captured by a mere tripwire. Zhu Shenji frowned, realizing that only Mo Mingmi held a grudge against them, and remarked on how dare they ambush and sneak attack on Cheng Dalei. He informed Kin Man that they would be taking their men to Kinchuan Mountain right away, and Kin Man angrily agreed, stating that if Mo Mingmi dared to touch Cheng Dalei, he would shred his body into pieces while the horse neighed aggressively. Su Ying told Zhu Shenji to wait and stated that they were not sure who actually sneak attacked him. She suggested that they should go back and see if there were any clues. Zhu Shenji instructed Kin Man to take more brothers with him to go back the way he came, splitting up to look for them. He ordered everyone to go back to the village and guard it to prevent anyone from taking advantage of Cheng Dalei's absence, whereas Liu Jihan was concerned about Cheng Dalei. Su Ying told Zhu Shenji that she went with him. Zhu Shenji retorted that she just arrived from a long journey, and that she must be tired, and Su Ying agreed. Su Ying, on the other hand, argued that Cheng Dalei was her husband and wondered how she could just sit at home when something bad happened to him. She expressed that she had to go. Liu Jihan told Su Ying that she wanted to go too. Su Ying argued with her, telling her that she should go back and wait, and Liu Jihan insisted that she, too, wanted to go, as did Yi Jidao. But Su Ying objected, telling them not to come and cause trouble, and Zhu Shenji agreed, telling them not to delay because they were going. After a while, someone directed the madam's attention to the horse footprints, which Su Ying noticed abruptly ended right there. Su Ying noticed that the grass went down and that there were signs of an ambush. Tin Man also found the rope, believing that Cheng Dalei must have been ambushed there. Zhu Shenji was shocked as he realized that Cheng Dalei was really captured. Su Ying looked around as she noticed something. She picked up a handkerchief and wondered what it was. She smelled the handkerchief. Su Ying recognized the smell as a drug residue, as well as a rogue hint and the smell of a woman's sweat. She asked Kin Man if Cheng Dalei recently offended any powerful female martial artist, which made Kin Man wonder what she meant. Kin Man informed her that a few days ago, a woman named Fan came to the village and began shouting at the seaport and he wondered if it was her. Su Ying inquired as to whether he knew where she was. Kin Man informed her that the woman came from the descending Jade Village, but that the location had yet to be found, and Su Ying directed him to send more people to investigate and locate the descending Jade Village as soon as possible. Su Ying stared at the handkerchief as she said nothing. She gritted as she guessed something. Su Ying went on to say that Cheng Dalei's disappearance was 80% related to Fan Lihua. After a while, at a vast field where animals gathered, at the entrance of the descending Jade Village, people were rushing in. A cage beside the tree held a silhouette of a man. A tongue licked a hand, causing saliva to flow. The horse continued licking Cheng Dalei's hands as he was unconscious. Cheng Dalei groaned, whereas the horse observed. The horse was spooked out as Cheng Dalei woke up wondering where he was. Cheng Dalei got the impression that he fell into descending Jade Village and got wounded by a pear blossom sword. He was puzzled about the mission's meeting, finding the content short with no hint. A mission notification appeared, stating that the triggering of Fan Lihua's third phase mission was checked. The content indicated he fell into descending Jade Village and was wounded by the Pear Blossom Sword. Cheng Dalei had an idea that he could be friendly and help Fan Lihua solve her problems. He pondered whether he would do it or not if there was a mission to make her a village mistress, claiming it would be better if it wasn't like that because Su Ying and Liu Jihan were waiting for him at home. He wondered if Su Ying would eat him alive if he brought another one back. 
Cheng Dalei inquired Hart about what was going on and if he could get some hints about the mission. Hart replied that there would be no hints and that he was free to explore. Giving spoilers would be meaningless, and Cheng Dalei agreed, arguing that he was stuck and couldn't explore. Fan Lihua interrupted their conversation, announcing that he was finally awake. She expressed her fear that he would wake up midway and informed him that she used twice the amount of drugs. She did not expect him to wake up so quickly, claiming he appeared to have a good physique. Cheng Dalei asked her what she wanted by capturing him. Fan Lihua chuckled and said she would hand him over to Mo Mingni because she thought he might give her a big reward for making him happy. Cheng Dalei responded because he initially perceived Fan Lihua as a heroic woman who would not succumb to others and would not do such a thing. Fan Lihua assured him that she would not hand him over to Mo Mingni because she did not like him either. Cheng Dalei asked her why she had captured him if she would not hand him over to Mo Mingni. He requested that she write a letter to send to the Toad Village if she was short on food and money and wanted to hold him as a hostage. Fan Lihua stated that she would not hide the fact that she had a special request from him. She feared he wouldn't want to help, so she could only invite him in this manner. Cheng Dalei responded that it didn't appear as if she wanted to ask as she knocked him out and locked him in an iron cage. She told him that she admired him for destroying the 100,000 Rings tribe army and assassinating Yang Longting in Chang'an City and the Ring tribe king in the grassland. Cheng Dalei dismissed it as insignificant. She said that, of all the people she challenged in the last two months, he was the one she barely considered a candidate. Whereas Cheng Dalei blushed at Fan Lihua's sitting position. Fan Lihua asked if he could stay in her village for a few days, and she also asked him for something. She stated that after it was all done, she would be very grateful to him. Cheng Dalei kept thinking not to be rude as he responded that there would be no harm in staying with her. He wondered who she wanted to kill, where she wanted to kill them, and how many as he wanted to finish the mission and see his wife as soon as possible. Fan Lihua was about to tell him what she wanted when a child ran in nervously, reporting to Fan Lihua. Fan Yue informed her that the people from the Western Yan tribe were coming. Fan Lihua was taken aback, wondering why they arrived so fast, leaving Cheng Dalei perplexed. She told Cheng Dalei that she would talk to him about the events later and asked him to stay, leaving Cheng Dalei speechless, while Fan Yue dragged her sister away, telling her that they were going. Cheng Dalei's face was filled with confusion. He yelled at Fan Lihua, telling her that she still not made it clear what she meant and what candidates she was referring to. He screamed asking her that she should at least finish their talk. Cheng Dalei was irritated and expressed his hate for people who say things halfway. After a while, a man greeted General Kai Deng, who greeted Elder Yin and stated that they met again. The group continued their march inside the village, where they passed by Cheng Dalei's cage. Cheng Dalei observed and wondered if they were the Ring tribe. He was curious as to why the Ring tribe would appear, as well as whether the descending Jade tribe was still colluding with them. He was also curious as to how so many Ring tribesmen got into the border. Elder Yin informed General Kai Dang that Fan Lihua was already waiting for him in the gathering hall. Cheng Dalei decided to try to obtain more information first as he viewed them for information. General Kai Dang's information appeared, as his real name was Kai Ju, and he was a famous military general. While Elder Yin Zhang's information stated that he was 65 years old and was Fan Lihua's uncle, Cheng Dalei thought that the second phase of the mission would be more complicated than he expected. Meanwhile at the descending Jade Village, Gathering Hall, Elder Yin informed Fan Lihua that the Ring tribe had come to visit her on their chief's order. Fan Lihua retorted, saying that if their intention was the same as before, there would be no need to say anything because they would not cooperate with the Western Yan tribe. Kai Ju stated that she misunderstood because they came to specially propose marriage to her, leaving Fan Lihua to question him again. Kai Ju went on to say that they heard she was looking for a husband and that their chief had long admired her, and that the betrothal gift was 1,000 tails of gold and 500 cows just to marry her. He also stated that they would be family from now on as long as she agreed. Fan Lihua stated, describing herself as a vulgar person rather than a social climber, and instructed them not to bring up the matter again. A man from the Ring tribe joined in, saying he advised her to think carefully because she was already 26 years old, while the others negotiated that their chief didn't mind her age and that if she was still unsatisfied they could add 20 more horses. Elder Yin begged her to reconsider, telling Fan Lihua that it was unusual for the Western Yan tribe chief to be sincere to her. Fan Lihua frowned at them and cursed. They asked Fan Lihua not to be shameless and questioned her if she truly believed she was worth 500 cows, and she threatened him not to blame her sword for being merciless if he said it again, while the ring argued, stating that if she could look at the entire Kinchuan mountain, no one else would want a violent girl like her apart from their ring tribe, which caused Fan Lihua to order her men to send their visitors away. 
She screamed at them to scram, and in the meantime, Cheng Dale believed that the sound of arguing he heard had reached him, and although he couldn't hear clearly, he believed that the two sides' friendly discussion did not go well. He wondered what the hell happened in the end. As Kaiju was about to leave, he scoffed, telling Elder Yin that she was foolish enough to reject a face-serving offer. Elder Yin told him to calm down because Fan Li Hua was simply unable to think clearly due to the suddenness of the news, and he assured him that he would persuade her well. Kaiju informed him that he didn't have much time, and that he would only give him one night. Elder Yin understood and told him that he would let the other village brothers persuade Fan Li Hua, assuring him that he would make her change her mind. Kaiju said something about Fan Li Hua refusing after that night. He gave him something and told him to use it, and when things were done, he would naturally get great benefits. Elder Yin recognized what Kaiju gave him and realized what he was trying. Kaiju asked him if he could not do it. Elder Yin informed him that Fan Li Hua was the orphan of his close friend's brother. Kaiju looked disappointed and said nothing. Then suddenly Elder Yin told him that he had to pay more, leaving Kaiju speechless. Meanwhile, someone urged Fan Li Hua that it was unusual for the chief of the Western Yan tribe to be infatuated with her. Elder Yin asked her why she had to say such harsh words, even if she didn't agree, and stated that their chief saw her as a woman, and that was her destiny, assuring her that there was nothing wrong with that. He also stated that if they killed them out of anger, they wouldn't be able to stop it. Fan Li Hua found it annoying. A voice addressed Fan Li Hua as her daughter and explained that she was just confused. Fan Li Hua's mother appeared and told her that she had already known all the things why the Western Yan tribe came. Fan Li Hua asked her mother why she was here. Fan Li Hua's mother told her that the Western Yan tribe was strong and powerful, and she asked why she didn't want to marry since they liked her. And she also reminded her that she was a girl, and fighting and killing all the time wasn't a long-term thing. She told her about her father, who was gone, and how she hoped to start a family soon believing that if she had good support, she would be rest assured. Fan Li Hua argued that the Ring tribe wanted her because they liked her horsemanship and wanted her to help them train a team of elite cavalry, and she also stated that her father was killed by them, leading her to wonder how she could marry her enemies. Fan Li Hua's mother was concerned, asking when she would have a family, and if she wasn't thinking about her age, she reminded her that she was already 26 and that if she continued like this, she would become an old girl, which no one wanted. She said that if she continued, she would have worries about when she would be able to have grandchildren. Fan Li Hua turned around and told her mother that she looked for someone. While her mother called out for her, she grabbed her gourd and walked out, declaring that she wanted her to submit to the Ring tribe. Fan Li Hua expressed that she couldn't do it. After a while, Cheng Dale wondered if Fan Li Hua forgot about him and when his brothers from the Toad Village would find him, hoping it would not be Zhu Shenji taking charge of the situation and making a plan. He reasoned that if Fan Li Hua's mission did not progress, he couldn't stay forever, and if he left for a while, he wouldn't know what would happen to the village as a result of Zhu Shenji. He closed his eyes, wondering if Su Ying and Liu Jihan were still waiting for him. Then suddenly, Fan Li Hua arrived calling out Cheng Dale. She asked if he was still not sleeping. Cheng Dale replied that he wanted to sleep, but he couldn't even stretch out, wondering how he could sleep in his housing area. His eyes widened as he was confused about what he saw. He thought that Fan Li Hua was in a bit of a bad state that day. Cheng Dale became aware of Fan Li Hua's gaze, and he assumed she ate people. He was curious how much she drank because she emitted a strong smell of alcohol, and he asked her if she was there to drink and talk about life at that late hour. He told her that it was now time for her to tell him what she wanted to do with him, but Fan Li Hua struggled to say what she wanted, which left Cheng Dale confused. Fan Li Hua grabbed his collar and told him he was a pervert if he didn't understand. As her breath reeked of alcohol, she yelled at him, stating that she wanted him as a person. She instructed him to marry her and become her husband. Cheng Dale's face flushed as he yelled in confusion over what she had said. Hard interrupted, mocking him and asking him if he still didn't get it. The Fan Li Hua exclusive special hidden mission had been achieved, according to a system notification. And a mission information appeared that he could choose the branch route. The first was to accept Fan Li Hua's request and become descending Jade Village husband. The second would be to escape from Descending Jade Village. Cheng Dale asked Hart what it meant to be the Descending Jade Village husband, and Hart replied that he had to become the village son-in-law, and he had to choose carefully. He grabbed Fan Li Hua's hands and told her that she was drunk. He advised her to be more reserved because they had only met a few times, and there was no such thing as a flash marriage, and he informed her that he already had a wife. Fan Li Hua wondered what his wife had to do with her, as she only wanted him as a person, not his wife, and informed him that if he married into her family, his former wife would no longer have anything to do with him. 
She expressed that marrying him wouldn't be a disgrace since he beat her, and that Toad Village and Descending Jade Village were considered to be the right match, and Cheng Dalei responded that being beaten up was also considered a win, and that he wondered if beating her meant he had to be responsible for her. Fan Lihua, on the other hand, claimed that he could have killed her in the sea that day but chose to protect her, and that she was not the type of person who refuses to accept defeat. She told him that he was the best candidate she had found in two months, leaving Cheng Dalei speechless. Cheng Dalei inquired as to why she was so eager to marry off. He stated that with her stunning and lovely appearance, she should have an endless stream of suitors, while wondering why him. Fan Lihua told him that he didn't need to ridicule her because she knew she was ugly. Cheng Dalei was confused about what she meant by ridicule and asked her if he had some misconceptions about her looks. Fan Lihua asked if she wasn't ugly and Cheng Dalei looked carefully and considered his response. He thought from what he observed she had a perfect girl's body with a thin waist, long legs, beautiful voice, and a proper supermodel figure. He wondered where the word ugly came from, while Fan Lihua questioned him why other men in the village avoided her if she wasn't ugly. Cheng Dalei wondered if it was because of today's beauty aesthetics that paid attention to a slender body. Oval face, wind-borne willow twig waist, just like Liu Jihan and Su Ying did. He also claimed that the average height at the time was not particularly high, asserting that Fan Lihua stood one head taller than many men, which inevitably made people feel unattainable. Besides, she was already 26 years old. Believing that an older unmarried youth of this era had been classified as the type of person nobody wanted, he looked at her and thought that in any case, Fan Lihua had such a good figure and was very feminine. And as long as she could be pampered to show her charm, she wouldn't be without suitors. Meanwhile, Fan Lihua chugged and gulped the contents of the bottle she had bought. She continued, as Cheng Dale observed her. Fan Lihua burped, causing Cheng Dale to believe that her bold drinking style was more manly than a man's, leading him to believe that he was wrong. Even if she had a good figure, her behavior was incompatible with femininity. Fan Lihua fumed, asking Cheng Dale what's with his look, and stated that he was just like everyone who thought that she was ugly. Cheng Dalei reasoned that she was beautiful and asked why she had to say she was ugly. Fan Lihu approached him after what he had said. She asked him if she was beautiful and if he craved her body, and Cheng Dalei replied that they could still chat happily, and wondered why he would crave her body when they had only met a few times. She tried seducing him, asking if he felt something. Cheng Dalei turned around and told Fan Lihua she was drunk. A system information popped up, stating that Fan Lihua received 10,000 critical damage. Fan Lihua was humiliated and wondered why he turned around and wouldn't even look at her. Cheng Dalei blushed as he reminded himself not to be rude and wondered why she wanted to rely on him when they only met a few times. He also wondered what happened to her that night, and if she wanted to be set free from herself after drinking because he didn't want to be sorry for Su Ying and he didn't want Fan Lihua to slip away. Cheng Dalei heard sobbing sounds as he sighed, wondering how he could do the mission, as it would be hard to accept a beauty's kindness. Fan Lihua cried and continued sobbing. Cheng Dalei turned to face her, surprised as he mentioned her name. Fan Lihua wiped her tears with her hand as she struggled to say something. She went on to inform him that she was born in a mountain bandit's den and didn't want to hang out with a group of rough men every day. She also stated that the men she beat up were talking behind her back, and without realizing it, they began calling her a tomboy, a monster girl, having dark skin, not knowing how to dress, and her hair like a chicken coop. She vented out that only the Ring tribe wanted her because they craved her little horsemanship. She grabbed Cheng Dalei's clothes and told him that it was now very hard for her to fancy a man and rob it back to him. She told him as she was about to punch him that she was still too shy to seduce a man. Her hands trembled, rhetorically asking Cheng Dalei if she was that ugly. Fan Lihua continued to curse at him, as he couldn't even look at her. She admitted that she did not like those rough men, and that the people she liked did not like her, which made her realize that no one would want to marry an ugly old girl like her. Cheng Dalei, concerned, called out to Fan Lihua. He expressed that in her eyes, Fan Lihua was an older unmarried youth at most, but she was definitely a great beauty. Cheng Dalei realized that in feudal times, a 26-year-old was classified as the type of person that nobody wanted. And besides, he believed that she was so careless that no man dared to approach her, claiming that a feudal society was too unethical. He called out to Fan Lihua, who told him to fuck off, but he coughed as he insisted. Cheng Dalei told her a poem about how the rain hit the pear blossoms and closed the door, forgetting the youth and missing the youth. Fan Lihua listened as Cheng Dalei continued the poem, asking who they could share their pleasant and happy feelings with, as they were overwhelmed by pain and joy. And as the poem went, he stated that sorrow gathered eyebrows and frowned all day. Thousands cried, ten thousands cried, 
and as you could see the sky in the morning and the clouds in the evening, you thought when you walked and when you sat. Cheng Dale ended it with the pear blossom bathed in the rain crying. People who saw would feel pity and address Fan Lihua, telling her not to cry because she would really become ugly if she kept crying. Fan Lihua responded by asking him if she was truly beautiful or if he was just making fun of her again. Cheng Dale admitted that she was beautiful and a stunning and lovely woman. He grasped her, telling her that she didn't have to show her breasts or pretend to be shy. Fan Lihua blushed as Cheng Dale caressed her. He went on to say that the real her was like the bright moon in the sky. Fan Lihua, embarrassed, asked him why the other men in the mountain village had avoided her like the plague if she wasn't ugly. Cheng Dale responded that it was because they didn't have good taste and mistook the fine jade for a midstone. Fan Lihua lowered her head and stared at Cheng Dale, but seeing him, although fallen into a trap, squeezed his face out, yet both of his eyes seemed as if they were painted with stars. Fan Lihua grabbed his wrist and called out his name. She excitedly asked him if he would marry her. Cheng Dale sweated profusely, reasoning that he only praised her for her beauty once and wondered why she still clung to him after he told her a moment later not to joke around because he had a wife. He remembered Su Ying biting him again, telling him that if she left a mark, he would never be stolen by other women again. Cheng Dale believed that, in order to coax Fan Lihua, he had gone too far in a slip of the tongue. He expressed his fear that they wouldn't be able to rest and fly together as he really loved his wife. Fan Lihua, on the other hand, claimed that he had defeated her and that his skills were better than hers. She expressed that she didn't mind him having a wife, and went on to say that she could be his concubine if he was not willing to marry into her family. Cheng Dale was in shock and puzzled by what she said. He assumed that in this era, being a concubine was the same as being a slave, which led him to believe that there was no way she didn't know. He wondered why she would say such a thing. He also questioned her willingness to be a concubine in order to marry herself off to someone she had only met a few times. Cheng Dale found it very suspicious that a proud and arrogant person, who was clearly a strong woman and the boss of a mountain village, would say something like that. He claimed that it wasn't because she was drunk or because she was fascinated by his sour poetry. Marrying him was just a pretense, and being ugly was just a way for her to better cover up her lies. He also thought that she was still looking at him in a negotiating attitude a while back. He believed that if she wanted him to help her deal with her family, like acting as her boyfriend type of help, he still doubted it because it had only been a few hours for her to become impatient. Cheng Dale was sweating profusely as he assumed Fan Lihua must have some kind of scheme but not enough time, which was why she was haltingly hanging on him. As soon as she opened her mouth, she was asking for marriage, leaving him to wonder what went wrong and if it had anything to do with the Ring Clan daytime visit. He assumed she offended the Ring Clan by choosing him because the Toad Village had the power to deal with them, which made him wonder if she wanted to drag the Toad Village down with her. He cursed, knowing that Fan Lihua's mission would be difficult because there was no girl in the world who insisted on marriage unconditionally. Cheng Dale noticed Fan Lihua's foolish and stupid temper with an ulterior motive, and thought that if he pointed it out right away, her scheme would fail, and he would be useless, prompting him to wonder if she would stab him with a knife. He pondered what he should do and whether he should run from the honey trap or continue the mission. He questioned why she was so eager to marry and suggested that they get to know each other first because he didn't like falling in love after marriage. He also informed her that even if he got a concubine, he would also need consent from his wife. Fan Lihua called him a useless blockhead and asked if he was that afraid of his wife, and Cheng Dale just laughed it off. Cheng Dale asked her if she could give him some time to think about it because things were happening so suddenly for him. She told him she could only give him one night and was cut off in the middle of her sentence. Fan Lihua mumbled in her sleep, prompting Cheng Dale to inquire about her. Cheng Dale wondered if she passed out thinking that she must have used a lot of courage to say her proposal, causing him to sigh and thinking that even though she was scheming something, she was still a bashful girl. Then, all of a sudden, Fan Yue appeared, relieved that she had finally found her because everyone had been searching for her and wondering why she had come all the way to the stable. She dragged her sister there and scolded her for sleeping there because she would catch a cold. Cheng Dale assumed that Fan Lihua ran into a problem that forced her into this situation. However, he ignored it, questioning her who told her to pick him, as he couldn't just give up on her when he still didn't know what was going on. He reasoned that he would just stay for a few more days to look around, believing that his brothers at the Toad Village should have almost discovered that he was there by then. While a system notification notified him that his current fear value increased to 1,014,320. In the morning, the next day, Cheng Dale asked Fan Lihua why she had come back. Fan Lihua said he was quite interesting 
and that he still acted casually even though he was trapped, and asked him if he was afraid to die and what he thought about yesterday's matter. And Cheng Dalei laughed and told her that it couldn't be taken seriously because yesterday's matter was nonsense spoken despite being drunk. Fan Lihua told him not to play dumb because she remembered what he said, and Cheng Dalei pleaded to be set free so he could go back and ask his wife, and if she agreed to let him take in a concubine, he would immediately come and marry her. Fan Lihua referred to him as a useless man and asked if he wanted to eat because he hadn't eaten anything all day. She held out a bowl of rice and told him if he agreed to marry her, he would get to eat. Cheng Dalei argued that it was not appropriate for him to sell his body for a bowl of porridge and mocked her food, advising her to do slightly to improve its quality. Fan Lihua became irritated and asked him if he was still complaining because letting him eat was not bad enough. She proceeded to gulp down the porridge. Cheng Dalei smirked as he observed her. Fan Lihua left nothing in the bowl and burped. She informed him that the food was all gone and that if he decided to become her husband, she would personally cook him a table of food. Cheng Dalei chuckled and said that with love, he would be fulfilled with just water, and that if he could see her every day, even if he had to eat sugar and shallow vegetables, he would still be willing. He asked her if she still had porridge. A tapping noise was heard nearby. Cheng Dalei wondered if it was the Ring Clan, while Fan Li Hua wondered why they had come in the first place and who had allowed them in. Chu Jai greeted Fan Li Hua as they approached her. He asked her what she thought about the matter regarding marriage. Before she became angry, Fan Li Hua told him there was nothing to talk about and to get lost, and she asked Elder Yin if he was the one who brought them in. She cursed at him as she asked him if he had brought the Ring Clan into the village to collude with them, and Elder Yin explained that they were only trying to bribe him with money and that it was an insult to him, while also telling her that it was all a misunderstanding. He went on to say that he wanted to refuse at first, but Chu Jai gave him too much, which was why he showed sincerity. Elder Yin stated that because he watched her grow up, he could be considered her uncle, and he naturally hoped that she would find a good spouse, and that now that Zai Yanbu was interested in her, it was their honor. Fan Li Hua told him that he didn't need to trouble himself because it was her business. She pointed at Cheng Dale and told them, honestly, that he was the person she liked. She went on to say that she caught him and that she was going to find a good day to marry him. Cheng Dalei figured out that she wanted to use him as a shield. Chu Jai mentioned that their custom was quite special, catching the guy you liked and imprisoning them to scorch them under the sun, and he wondered if she intended on drying him up before entering the bridal room, prompting Elder Yin to question her if she was not joking, and Chu Jai responded by asking Elder Yin who the guy was. Elder Yin informed him that he was a hostage that she captured the day before, which caused Chu Jai to mutter in confusion and ask Fan Li Hua if she was playing with him. He threatened her if she didn't want them to go ahead and snatch her because she was taking the hard way, which irritated Fan Lihua. Fan Lihua yelled, wondering where the brothers of the descending Jade Village were and if everyone had become a traitor. Elder Yin smirked as he told her not to waste her effort because while she chatted with her hostage, they got rid of all her loyal subjects. He chuckled and inquired as to why she couldn't get any news. Elder Yin told Fan Lihua that she woke up late that day, and he calculated the time, believing that it would be about time. Fan Li Hua began to vomit blood. She realized that the breakfast she had that day was poisoned. Worried, Cheng Dalei shouted Li Hua's name, realizing there was trouble, and urged to escape the metal cage as soon as possible. Li Hua, on the other hand, expressed frustration. Yin Zhang informed Kai Ju to retrieve Li Hua as she was poisoned. Kai Ju then ordered his men to tie her up and take her away, explaining that she was weakened by the poison and that her strength was left in her body. His men then began to attack Li Hua who appeared powerless and struggled to stand. However, Li Hua advised them that even though she was weak, they couldn't do as they pleased. Suddenly, she employed the crushed jasmine pear blossom cut technique and swiftly slashed out one of her villagers. As the man was being cut, she mentioned that the descending jade village was also affiliated with the fans. Shocked, Kaiju cursed and wondered how she still had strength, questioning why Yin Zhang did not give her more drugs to weaken her further. Yin Zhang responded that he had already given Li Hua double the usual dose, insisting that even horses would collapse. The sword's light blossomed like pear blossoms, and the shadow moved faster than a star as Li Hua swiftly sliced through the men, their screams echoing in pain. Boundless flew the descending jade, small jasmine pear blossoms one after another, slaughtering all who surrounded her. Determined, Yin Zhang ordered his men to capture her, mocking them as a bunch of losers and emphasizing that she was weakened. 
He also instructed them to quickly bring the person he had told them to catch. While Li Hua continued slashing out the people who met their demise, the men questioned what kind of monster she was. Struggling, Li Hua pondered the pain she felt, realizing it was poison causing cramps and weakness throughout her body. Facing her enemies, she also reflected on the state of her village during the two months she was away, defaced by wretched people. She remembered her beloved people poisoned one morning and did not even manage to get the message to her and the rest of the village turned their swords against her. Slowly placing her swords to her neck, she contemplated that if captured, it would amount to nothing more than being sent to the Ring Clan to face humiliation. With determination, Lihua concluded that in such a case, it would be better to die. Yin Zhong and Kaiju panicked, realizing her intent. They urgently ordered their men to quickly bring her up. While Cheng Dalei shouted at her not to do it and tried to break the cage, he screamed for the key and offered his help. Exhausted, Li Hua turned her head to Cheng Da Lei, wondering if he wanted to save her, questioning if anything would change even if he got out and what would change. She noted that Cheng Da Lei's men were not there, and only the Ring Clan was present. She also pondered that if Cheng Da Lei revealed his identity, it could mean facing hundreds of Ring Clan members and likely death. She thought about pulling him down to fight against the rings, but it seemed futile. Perhaps Cheng Da Lei already knew that, which might explain his treatment of her. She then spoke and told him not to come out. Frightened, Cheng Dale could only call out Li Hua's name, feeling helpless. However, Yin Zhang was annoyed and questioned her if she wasn't afraid to die. Then he threatened her with her mother and Yue, suggesting she didn't care for them anymore. Her mother called her name, while Yue resisted and told Li Hua not to mind them and urged her to leave. With fear evident on her face, Li Hua called out to her mother and Yue. While Yin Zhang continued, questioning if she dared to kill herself and leave her mother and Yue behind. He warned that once she died, she should know what the rings would do to them, asking if she couldn't see the big picture and think of others. Li Hua struggled to stand as Yin Zhang threatened to send Yu Er to the ring tribe if she died. He painted a grim picture of the potential mistreatment Yu Er might face, suggesting she could end up with an unknown number of men. In response, Li Hua challenged him, asking if he dared. Yin Zhang continued, insisting that when Yu Er grew up, she would blame Li Hua for leaving her and causing her suffering in the world. He suggested that everyone would be happy if Li Hua married Kaiju and urged her to think about the others. Although fear was visible on Yue's face, she still told Li Hua not to mind her and to escape quickly. Yin Zhang suggested that she should let herself be arrested without fighting back. Suddenly, in response, Li Hua released her sword and knelt. As the breath released from the bottom of her heart, her body struggled to support itself. Kaiju then ordered his men to tie her up. While Li Hua was being held, Yin Zhang asked her why she was bothered and Li Hua responded by threatening him and vowing to kill him. Yin Zhang told Li Hua that they were all from the same village and questioned why they drew swords against each other. He held Li Hua's face, emphasizing that if she came to her senses earlier, so many of their men wouldn't have lost their lives. Disappointed, Yin Zhang showed pity and remarked that her eyes seemed lifeless. He suggested that she be good and contribute to the Ring tribe, highlighting that her mother and Yue were safe in his hands, while Li Hua just stared at him. Meanwhile, Kai Ju's men called him, emphasizing the trouble they faced and questioning if Li Hua could still marry the chief. In response, Kaiju stated that their chief didn't lack women and that marriage was merely a pretense. He noted that they wanted Li Hua for her horsemanship, and as long as her family was in their hands, forcing her to train a group of elite cavalries was not a problem. Kaiju called Yin Zhang and informed him that the descending Jade Village was now under his control. He instructed Yin Zhang to handle his village, suggesting killing those who needed to be killed and locking up those who needed to be locked. He then mentioned that he would be taking Li Hua away, and Yin Zhang agreed and wished him well. As they watched Li Hua being taken away, Yin Zhang addressed the villagers, stating that it was good for them that Li Hua had married their western Yan tribe. He then ordered to put Li Hua's mother and Yue in the dungeon and keep them under close guard. Smirking, he emphasized that with the Ring tribe's protection, they would surely be able to soar in the future. Suddenly, Yin Zhang noticed a sound from behind when Cheng Dalei expressed his exhaustion. He mentioned that not anyone could imitate Uncle Long's method of breaking the iron cage. Surprised, Yin Zhang then noticed Cheng Dalei and said that he came out on his own. And also, the villagers questioned how he wrenched open the cage with his bare hands. One person disagreed, commenting that it wasn't bare hands but soaked clothes and branches that were used. At that moment, the villagers seemed to see a hungry jackal freed from its cage. Cheng Dalei released a tremendous aura. He told them that he was hungry and asked if they had any food. Serious, he dismissed his request and emphasized that he should save people first. Cheng Dalei mentioned that although it was a little late, at least the mission objective had been clarified. 
villagers commented that he was not afraid to die, while Yin Zhang asked Cheng Dalei what he was doing out there. While brushing off the dust from his body, Cheng Dalei responded that he would settle things quickly and then eat. He mentioned that he didn't know whether the food in that village was poisonous or not, noting that he was most annoyed by people who spoiled food. Cheng Dalei then told Yin Zhang that to prevent him from backstabbing, he threatened to kill everyone there first and then save Li Hua. Angry, Yin Zhang told Cheng Dalei that he was just a hostage and shouldn't dare to be arrogant. He ordered someone to kill him and send him to die. The villagers attacked Cheng Dalei, shouting at him for daring to act that way and threatening to kill him. Swiftly, Cheng Dalei jumped, striking the person's jaw with his knee, and seized the sword. He threw the sword to grab it and slashed one of the villagers. The other villagers, seeing Cheng Dalei approach with a sword, were trembling and surprised but fearful to get close to him. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei commented on the blade of the sword that there was no good sword because it felt uncomfortable. However, he dismissed it, stating that he was in a rush and it would make do. He dashed towards the villagers, while they warned each other to be careful of his attack, with some urging to kill him. As Cheng Dalei slashed out at the villagers, he pondered that by using sword skills with a blade, the power would decrease, but it would be enough to deal with the underlings. He slaughtered the villagers using the Alfei blade technique with incredible speed. With each move, the fear point values increased rapidly. The shouts of fear echoed. Determined, Yin Zhang continued to order someone to kill Cheng Dalei quickly. He assured his villagers not to be scared while he insulted them. Yin Zhang contemplated who Cheng Dalei was and since Li Hua captured him, she had been hiding him there, not allowing anyone to come near. He wondered how the strong Cheng Dalei got trapped in their village. Frustrated, he questioned himself about which esteemed master Li Hua had kidnapped. He hurriedly ran with his horse and told his villagers that they should hold on while he went to find Kaiju to ask for reinforcements. Along with those who died and those who ran away, this massacre only went on for a few hours. Surprised, Yuer couldn't believe what she saw when she noticed Cheng Dalei standing there, looking quite formidable. Yuer questioned Cheng Dalei if he was saving them, recalling what Li Hua had told her about him being someone kidnapped from the outside. She asked who Cheng Dalei was, while Cheng Dalei was covered in bloodstains. Cheng Dalei told her that they could talk about it later, and that they should leave first. He instructed them that they were more familiar with their village, suggesting they find a place to hide. And if there was a secret passage, they should escape through it and remember to block it after escaping to prevent pursuers from catching up. He told them not to let the Ring Clan catch them and reassured them that he would take care of Lihua. At the same time, the Ring Clan got ready to leave the descending Jade Village. While Lihua was tied up on the horse and appeared tired, when Yin Zhang's voice reached to call Kaiju's attention, he rushed towards him and told him to wait a moment. Puzzled, Kaiju asked Yin Zhang why he came again. Yin Zhang informed Kaiju that a problem occurred. While he expressed gratitude to the heavens in his thoughts, he continued to express thanks, thinking that the Ring Clan had not left yet. His expression showed joy as he believed that if he reached the Ring Clan, he could let them deal with Cheng Dalei. Putting an end to his contemplation, Yin Zhang turned around and was frightened to see Cheng Dalei leap behind him and swiftly get killed. Surprised, Kaiju commented that Yin Zhang was killed. His followers seemed to recognize Cheng Dalei as the person who was locked up in the cage. Li Hu was surprised as well, and the rest of the Ring Clan stopped. Kaiju inquired about Cheng Dalei's identity, commenting that judging by his skills, there was no way he was unheard of. He asked for Cheng Dalei's name. Cheng Dalei stood in front of them, wondering why they didn't recognize him. He thought that perhaps they had never seen his face before, especially now that he was holding a normal blade and not the special sword. In that case, he decided it was better not to introduce himself. Instead, he responded to the Ring Tribe, stating that if they were asking for his name, he should start talking from when Nua started making people. A glowing smoke emerged around Cheng Dalei and continued talking, stating that if they were asking for his surname, they would have to discuss splitting heaven and earth apart. However, they were asking about who he was. A beep from the system indicated a significant increase in fear value from 1,335,110 to 100W. Cheng Dalei told them that they could treat him as a village husband that she snatched. Another beep followed, informing them using Horn's war song, with a fear value of 10W. The time for reinforcement to reach was unknown, and reinforcements were approaching, signaling that the battle would soon start. Kaiju swiftly issued orders to kill Cheng Dalei. The ringers were furious, questioning how Cheng Dalei dared to charge towards them by himself. Defending themselves, the Ring Clan wielded their spears, shouting for Cheng Dalei to die. Four spears lunged toward Cheng Dalei, but to their surprise, Cheng Dalei disappeared, showcasing remarkable speed. 
They warned each other to be careful as he appeared above them. While still in the air, Cheng Dale wondered where Li Hua was, concern evident as he clenched his teeth. His gaze focused as he spotted her in the clutches of a ringer, realizing that he found her. With confidence, Cheng Dale declared that they did it, and swiftly unleashed his exploding fireworks, slicing through the ringers that attacked him. The injured ringer growled in pain as Cheng Dale aimed to break through and open a path. Amidst the chaos, the ringers continued shouting to surround Cheng Dale. Others informed that Cheng Dale broke in, and the lines were breaking up, commanding others to maintain their formation and continue to order others to surround and kill him. Beside Kaiju, his men commented that Cheng Dale was driving straight in and questioned where such an incredible Cheng Dale came from. Kaiju mentioned that Cheng Dale was breaking in that direction. Worried, he noticed that his target was Li Hua's direction. Cheng Dale's fear value kept increasing as he continued killing the ringers on his way. He cut off the arms of one of the ringers and said that he was coming straight ahead, while the fear value kept increasing. Cheng Dale shouted Li Hua's name, who confusedly looked at him. He urged her to ride with him fast. Li Hua hesitated and responded that she could not go with him as her mother and Yu Er. However, Cheng Dale assured her that he had already saved them and that they had run away, reminding her of her experience as a horse rider and encouraging Li Hua to take him on in a race. Cheng Dale promised to cover for her when they broke out. Enraged, Kaiju ordered the ringers not to let them get away, while the ringers accused Cheng Dale of daring to steal their people. The two masters combined their power to break through. Li Hua instructed Cheng Dale to go on while she focused on riding the horse, leaving the enemies to him. Cheng Dale declared that they would tear away from the siege. He slashed at a ringer attacking them, causing the ringer to scream in pain. As they approached the village gate, the ringers informed them that they could not block them. Kaiju realized the urgency and instructed his people to block off the main gate, ensuring Cheng Dale and Li Hua couldn't escape. He directed the second team to withdraw to the back and block the village gate, urging them not to let them get out of the gate. Some of the ringers cursed and questioned what kind of monster they faced. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale commented that the ringers were adjusting their formation, and it didn't look good because they blocked off the village gate. Li Hua noted that if they forcefully broke and might lead to them getting surrounded. Cheng Dale asked if the mountain village had another road, and Li Hua confirmed that there was a secret passage at the meeting hall, providing a route for retreat. Cheng Dale acknowledged it, stating that they should turn back to the mountain village. Li Hua urged him to hold on tight as she increased their speed, emphasizing that he shouldn't fall from the horse. Then Cheng Dale hugged Li Hua's waist, causing her to be flustered. She scolded him, telling him not to grope around. Cheng Dale was surprised and apologized to her, explaining that it was not on purpose. Li Hua quickly commented that in a few more days, when they got married, he could touch her and he shouldn't be impatient. Cheng Dale was left confused by her words. The two of them teamed up, easily escaped the siege, and headed towards the inside of the mountain village. As they arrived back at Descending Jade Village, Cheng Dale assisted Li Hua in walking and asked if she was okay. Li Hua reassured him that she was fine, mentioning that the drug wouldn't kill her and she could still manage. Cheng Dale attempted to make a light-hearted joke, suggesting that he understood the pain of having a period, likening it to having an ant. But Li Hua just gave him a confused look and wondered what he was talking about. Suddenly, Cheng Dale surprised her by carrying her. He told her that if she didn't want to do strenuous exercise, he was there for her. Cheng Dale asked her where the secret passage was that he would carry Li Hua until there. Embarrassed, Li Hua directed him to the secret passage in the basement of the gathering hall. Cheng Dale playfully commented on her weight, suggesting she should lose some. Li Hua retorted, telling him to go to hell. Laughing, Cheng Dale changed the subject, urging her to take the antidote. Li Hua questioned where he got it, and he casually replied that he snatched it from Yin Zhong. A beep notified Cheng Dale of a fear point exchange for the antidote, and his current fear point decreased to 1351. After a while, they reached the basement of the house. Li Hua instructed Cheng Dale to put her down as they had arrived. She looked puzzled at the rocks she saw and questioned what was going on. Cheng Dale asked her what was wrong. Worried, Li Hua explained that the secret passage was blocked, and it was deliberately sealed from the inside after someone had left. She expressed her frustration, wondering how it could happen. The secret passage was supposed to be known only to high-ranking individuals. Suspicious, she doubted that Yin Zhang was responsible. She cursed him, believing that he had planned everything so well that even the only secret passage was blocked. Cheng Dale sweated as he remembered the time he instructed Yuer to block the secret passage after their escape. Feeling guilty and unable to admit the truth, he looked at Li Hua without saying anything. Embarrassed to confess, he asked if there were any other secret passages in the area, 
Considering the descending Jade Village size, Li Hua glanced back at him and responded that there were no other secret passages. Cheng Dale asked again if that was the only one, and Li Hua confirmed that it was the only one. Meanwhile, the ringers surrounded the village. A person reported to Kaiju that they were hiding inside. Kaiju instructed them to quickly go in and get them out. He commanded his men to dismount and form a perimeter, ensuring that no one could escape. As the ringer rushed inside the house, Cheng Dale realized they were there. He asked Li Hua where his sword was. Li Hua informed him that it was in her room. Cheng Dale asked where her room was, and she said it was on the second floor. In a rush, they went upstairs. Outside, Kaiju ordered his men to guard the intersections. Upon entering the house, they found it as they went upstairs. The ringers quickly instructed each other to be cautious as Cheng Dale was known for his strength. The ringers followed them upstairs, and a person announced that they were there and suggested others to break down the door. Someone ordered to kill Cheng Dale and take Li Hua. At that moment, Cheng Dale swiftly unsheathed his special sword and used the exploding fireworks technique to slaughter the ringers that were near the door. The ringers were surprised and seemed to realize their mistake. Thus filled the air from the broken door, and Li Hua asked Cheng Dale if they could stop the ring clan. Cheng Dale replied that he didn't know. While tying his sword to his hand, he mentioned that he couldn't stop them all. The ringers suddenly became scared as they recognized Cheng Dale. A ringer mentioned that the sword Cheng Dale held was an ordinary sword, which made his face change to fear, and he struggled first to utter Cheng Dale's name. It was notified that the possession duration was halfway through the incense stick. Forced into a corner, a wave of attacks approached them like a tidal wave. Ringers shouted to kill as they closed in. The two joined forces, acting like a sharp sword that split the enemy tide. Some questioned how many people had to die to kill them, while others expressed frustration and cursed as they saw bodies around. Others hesitated to go because he was Cheng Dale, even if he was the bravest warrior of the rings. One assured his companions not to be afraid upon hearing Cheng Dale's name. Others commented that Cheng Dale and Li Hua were exhausted, urging everyone to go. Some hesitated, informing others that they would go first. Facing a prey cornered to death, one recommended Tease to take the lead. They were also afraid of the prey's death-defying counterattack in a desperate situation. The two gasped, with Cheng Dale asking Li Hua if she could still hold up, and Li Hua nodded. The set quickly shifted as a ringer pushed out from the window and shouted as he got thrown. With a loud thud on the ground, the ringers outside were shocked to witness T's defeat. Some expressed surprise, mentioning T's reputation as a skilled soldier in the army. Meanwhile, Kaiju observed the situation with a clenched jaw. T struggled to stand up but still managed to call Kaiju's attention, informing Kaiju that the man inside was Cheng Dale. Kaiju, surprised, asked who it was again. T seriously repeated Cheng Dale's name and mentioned that it was the one who wiped out 100,000 of their warriors in Yuzhu in one fell swoop. Shocked, Kaiju struggled to comprehend how Cheng Dale ended up there. T explained that it was indeed him holding the ordinary sword, and he couldn't be mistaken. In disbelief, Kaiju considered the merit of killing Cheng Dale and presenting his head to Jin Wendao. He believed that catching such a big fish would bring him immense merit. Determined, he ordered his men to set fire to the house and proclaimed that they wouldn't take Li Hua anymore. The ringers, shocked, warned Kaiju that their men were still inside the house and urged him to reconsider, emphasizing the presence of many wounded their men. Undeterred, Kaiju insisted that if they could kill Cheng Dale, no matter how many died, it would be worth it. He commanded his men to set the house on fire. After he set the order, the ringer quickly spread kerosene, straw, and wood. They ignited the fire, causing it to quickly spread throughout the house. Kaiju continued to command his men to guard the four sides, preventing Cheng Dale from escaping. The ringers inside panicked as they ran out and some warned others to run faster. Meanwhile, inside the house, Li Hua was furious, questioning how they dared to set fire to them. Cheng Dale responded, criticizing them for giving up without allowing the wounded people to move out, implying that they didn't have a heart. Frustrated, Cheng Dale realized that the possession time ran out, the physical fear points bottomed out, and reinforcements did not arrive. He cursed the situation. Li Hua reassured him not to worry about her and urged him to escape for his life. However, Cheng Dale questioned what she was talking about and if she joked. Tired, Li Hua commented on Cheng Dale's skills stating that he could break out completely and mentioned that she had no more strength. She pointed out that if he took her, he wouldn't be able to escape. Cheng Dale asked her what she meant, emphasizing that he was a man and couldn't leave a woman behind. He piggybacked Li Hua and mentioned that if they came this far, they couldn't just give up. Li Hua murmured his name, asking if they couldn't escape. 
She requested that if escape wasn't possible, she asked Cheng Dale to kill her with his own hands, as it would be better than being humiliated by the Ring tribe. Cheng Dale firmly told her not to talk nonsense and to try to recover her strength. Li Hua sought an answer from Cheng Dale. He responded that he could only guarantee that he would protect her until his life burned out. Kaiju noted that the weather was warm and dry, and the fire would burn more once it caught the wind. When the fire stops, they find their body and the ordinary sword and he brings it to Jin Wendao. Kaiju also ordered his men to keep their eyes on the perimeter and not let Cheng Dale and Li Hua get out. T remarked that with such a massive fire, it would be challenging to escape unless they could fly. Shocked, everyone exclaimed to look, realizing that Cheng Dale and Li Hua were on the roof. They said that Cheng Dale was not dead yet. Kaiju reassured his men not to worry, stating that Cheng Dale wouldn't survive if he dared to jump down, as they would hack him to death. Surrounded by flames, Cheng Dale simply commented on how big and beautiful the fire was. On the other side, Kaiju told his men that either Cheng Dale and Li Hua would be buried in a sea of fire, or they would jump down into the enemy and be killed. He giggled, expressing that it didn't matter how they died, as that was presumably what he wanted. Li Hua asked Cheng Dale if he remembered what she had asked him last night. Cheng Dale responded that her question about getting married was no longer relevant. He glanced at Li Hua and told her that, as matters stand, she interrupted his statement, disagreeing that it did not make sense. She continued, saying that from the moment he chose to appear to save her, that question became incredibly important to her. She slowly got nearer to Cheng Dale's face and said that she knew he didn't want to answer the question, but if they both survive in the end. She suddenly kissed Cheng Dale, surprising him, and his face turned red while they were on the rooftop engulfed in flames. Li Hua let go of the kiss and vowed that she swears that she would make Cheng Dale fall in love with her. As the fire grew bigger, the ringer who watched commented that the fire reached the top floor, indicating that Cheng Dale and Li Hua were not coming down and appeared to be buried alive in the sea of fire. Another person chimed in, expressing regret that Li Hua's talent might have been burned to death. Another person asked Kaiju if the general might blame them for not being able to bring Li Hua back in time. Kaiju questioned them about what they were afraid of, emphasizing that if they retrieved Cheng Dale's corpse, he thought that Kaiju could not wait to reward them generously. In the blazing fire, Cheng Dale and Li Hua jumped from the roof, catching the attention of the Ring tribe and announcing that they were still alive. Despite Kaiju's command to surround and kill them, Cheng Dale and Li Hua skillfully used the Pear Blossom Slash and Exploding Fireworks technique to fend off the attackers. The two teamed up to face the enemy, within three feet swords danced in the air, and no one survived. Witnessing Cheng Dale and Li Hua's successful defense, the Ring Tribe members were both in awe and expressed frustration. One member even suggested to Kaiju that with the bravery shown by the bandits, they would only end up losing more lives if they continued the siege. However, Kaiju remained adamant in his command, urging his people to persist, drain their opponents' physical strength, and use their swords to kill them. They surrounded Cheng Dale and Li Hua, stating that they absolutely could not escape. Someone suggested dropping their weapons to give them a painless death. Li Hua turned to Cheng Dale, mentioning that they had no strength and that it was over. However, the system suddenly informed Cheng Dale that they were there. Smirking, Cheng Dale became confident and said the show had just begun, dismissing the notion of an ending. Cheng Dale remained confident, challenging the Ring clan, and claimed that his master had worshipped the South Pole Immortal as a teacher, stating that Tianbai Golden Star was his sworn brother, and Marshal Tianpeng was his senior brother. Cheng Dale challenged them, saying that he could ask his senior brother, Marshal Tianpeng, to summon 3,000 celestial troops and generals through a phone call and let them witness what was called a chrysanthemum full of injuries. Disbelieving, T asked what Cheng Dale meant. Kaiju responded to his men that Cheng Dale was just pretending, stating that his surname was Cheng and that they shouldn't act crazy. Suddenly, the sound of many horses rumbling from afar could be heard, approaching the village. Determined, Kin Man shouted that if they didn't release Cheng Dale, they would slaughter all the people in the village. T commented that it was not good and that an enemy was coming from behind. Another ringer expressed doubt, questioning if it's the celestial troops and wondering why there are so many of them. Kaiju insulted his men, shouting that they shouldn't panic because it was just Cheng Dale's reinforcement. He ordered them to get on their horses to prepare for battle. 500 grassland soldiers shouted and sheathed their swords, while Kin Man informed everyone that he found Cheng Dale who was being besieged by the Ring tribe. He commanded that they go and break the Ring siege and save Cheng Dale. As they clashed, one of Cheng Dale's men laughed and said that it had been a long time since he killed a ring clan. In just one round iron hoof charge, the people in front of Cheng Dale were dispersed. 
Qin Man suggested that Cheng Dale should take a rest, and they would take care of the others. Li Hua questionably asked what was going on. Cheng Dale responded that he was leaving it to him. Zhang Fei commanded to protect Cheng Dale and kill all the ringers. It's hard to even call it a battle. After all, the mountain bandits had an absolute advantage in numbers, while they were still eager to wipe them out that they took no survivors as they shouted kills. The unequal battle only lasted half an hour. After that moment, the trouble ceased and things started to settle down. Kin Man reported to Cheng Dale, saying that more than 500 rings were all wiped out and they seized hundreds of horses and some gold and silver. He continued that they also captured more than a hundred people from descending Jade Village. They said they were hiding and not involved in the rebellion, and that the village was their territory. Cheng Dale responded, saying that they were there to save him, but he felt like they were there to rob as well. He mentioned that the mistress of the village was still around, while the system beeped that he completed a robbery mission. Confused, Kin Man asked him if descending Jade Village captured him and inquired about what he would do with Lihua who kidnapped him. Lihua, who was nearby, lowered her head as she heard all of it. Cheng Dale defended Lihua, stating that she had only invited him to her village for guidance. Unfortunately, she encountered a traitor in her village who colluded with the Ring tribe and started a rebellion. Kin Man seemed to believe Cheng Dale's explanation, and Lihua was surprised and uttered Cheng Dale's name. Cheng Dale continued to explain, suggesting that it was all a misunderstanding. He continued, emphasizing that Li Hua was her friend only and not an enemy, that she had no intention of harming him. Suddenly, not far away, Yue rushed towards them and called Li Hua's name, asking where she was. Shenji, who was accompanying Yue, explained that they caught Yue and an old woman behind the village. Yue mentioned that she wanted to find a guy with no clothes, and when Shenji heard it, he brought her to them. Yue called Li Hua, crying. Relieved, Li Hua only called Yue's name while Yue hugged her. Li Hua inquired about their mother, and Yue replied that she was shocked and went into the house to rest. Yue asked about the people with them. Flirtatious, Li Hua introduced Cheng Dale as her husband and explained that the people who came to save them were Cheng Dale's men, causing Cheng Dale to shiver, while Yue was shocked at the revelation. Shenju was surprised by what Li Hua said. He suddenly cursed and quickly told Cheng Dale that he took only two days and managed to seduce another village master. Yue blushed and asked again if she got married. Kin Man was embarrassed and informed Cheng Dale that Su Ying was waiting for him at home. Yue added that Cheng Dale was her brother-in-law and kept mentioning that Li Hua was about to get married. With a proud expression, Li Hua agreed and reassured her that when she and Cheng Dale got married, Descending Jade and Toad Village became one family. Embarrassed, Cheng Dale asked what she was talking about. Li Hua seduced Cheng Dale as she hushed him, telling him to listen to her first. Cheng Dale tried to stop her. Suddenly Li Hua became serious and whispered to Cheng Dale's ear that the Western Yan tribe lost more than 500 men in Descending Jade Village, and they would likely send troops for revenge. She feared that the remaining people from her village wouldn't survive if the Ring Clan attacked again. She continued, revealing that, in the past, she challenged martial arts masters to find someone who could beat her and help her escape a forced marriage. In the end, she caught him, but he got involved in their clan's inner rebellion. Li Hua emphasized that Cheng Dale had the power to confront the Ring Clan, and it was the Ring Clan who feared Cheng Dale. Li Hua expressed the need for an ally like Toad Village. She proposed that her village would follow Toad Village's command in the future, hoping for Cheng Dale's help when the Ring Clan returned. However, she couldn't simply hand over her entire village, which was her father's hard-earned inheritance. So, she proposed that if they got married, her village, including herself, would belong to Cheng Dale. Feeling uneasy, Cheng Dale thought Li Hua was talking in circles, leading to the idea that it was difficult to handle a beautiful woman's favor. Cheng Dale was feeling uneasy and hesitant, afraid that rejecting her proposal might make Li Hua angry and end up beating him. Cheng Dale distanced himself, snapping his fingers to confirm what Li Hua had said. He promised her that from that moment on, Toad Village and Descending Jade Village would be allies, living and facing challenges together. As a condition, Li Hua would now be considered one of his people. Following this statement, a beep from the system confirmed that his mission was completed. The system expressed satisfaction, suggesting that Cheng Dale had won over Li Hua's heart and teasing him about having many plans for the next steps. It hinted at the initiative Li Hua might take, emphasizing the bravery of ladies from the prairie in matters of both love and hate. Li Hua asked when they would get married. Overjoyed, Li Hua giggled, stating that she was now Cheng Dale's. She expressed concern about moving too fast and playfully asked about naming their first child, finding the idea shameful. 
playing dumb, Cheng Dalei focused on practical matters, stating that he would send people to help rebuild the Sending Jade Village to prevent the Ring Clan from seeking revenge. He instructed Li Hua that he would trouble her to help him train cavalry and take care of horses and casually offered her a monthly salary for her efforts, leaving Li Hua confused. With a bewildered expression, she stopped Dalei and inquired about his intentions regarding her taking care of horses and the offered salary. Cheng Dale clarified that she was now considered someone hired by him, and he was leaving that aspect of the job to her. Hurt, Li Hua sought clarification, asking if she was just considered one of his people. She urged him not to insinuate that he was hiring her to take care of horses and train soldiers. Cheng Dale nonchalantly confirmed and questioned if there were any problems. He explained that Descending Jade Village excelled in taking care of horses and was skilled in horsemanship and emphasized that their villages were mutually helping each other, offering a monthly salary of 500 silvers for her village and expressing a willingness to add more. In the end, Cheng Dalei decided to play dumb. Li Hua, with an adorable expression of frustration, persisted that he was wrong, that she was not talking about that, and insisted that he knew what she meant and shouldn't feign ignorance. She insulted Cheng Dalei, stating that he was worse than a lady, and demanded an answer. However, Cheng Dalei laughed at her only, which made Yu Er concerned. Yu Er called Li Hua, asking what they were arguing about, and she attempted to intervene, advising Li Hua to control her temper and not scare her brother-in-law away. However, Li Hua dismissed Yu Er's advice, stating that it was an adult problem and asking the children not to interrupt. Su Ying watched them from a distance, while Cheng Dalei continued to chuckle. While Li Hua clung to Cheng Dalei, he noticed Su Ying and called her by name. Su Ying directly asked who Li Hua was. Feeling guilty, Cheng Dalei struggled to come up with a story and quickly said that it was a long time since they last met, fearing that he couldn't say anything wrong, or his life would be in danger as he thought about it. Angry, Xiao Yi scolded Cheng Dalei, calling him a playboy, and questioned why Su Ying took the time to come there just to find him hugging and touching another woman. Cheng Dalei replied, saying that Xiao Yi shouldn't talk nonsense, and that he was constantly keeping his body pure. Serious and silent, Su Ying decided to take Cheng Dalei with her, insisting that they go back home. While watching, Kin Man speculated that Cheng Dalei might have to kneel on the washboard when he gets home. Chen Ji added that it was a habit that kept attracting trouble, and that Cheng Dalei couldn't change. Observing them, Li Hua wondered if Su Ying was Cheng Dalei's wife, while Yu Er, with an irritable demeanor, asked who Su Ying was and why she took Cheng Dalei away. Li Hua explained that Su Ying was the tall wall she needed to overcome. Yu Er questioned her about the tall wall, stating that Su Ying wasn't tall at all, at least not taller than her. Li Hua replied that it wasn't just about height and that Su Ying was trouble. Yu Er asked Li Hua if she had confidence, and Li Hua confirmed and added that, as the saying goes, with the proper pickaxe, no wall can't be broken. Meanwhile, in the system space, the machine flew towards the space. As it flew, it entered codes, and the access request permission was allowed. Upon entry, the machine questioned the system that had been hiding in the space for days, asking about her activities. It questioned her about recent events involving Cheng Dalei particularly a flirtatious situation that nearly led to him being beaten by hundreds of people. The machine was puzzled as to why she didn't intervene and instead sent her clone. In response, the system downplayed the situation, considering it just a few hundred people in small cases like a piece of cake. She believed Cheng Dale could handle it. However, in the realm of the system space, there was something more important that needed her attention. Curious, the machine inquired about the matter. The system revealed that the second fairy was about to emerge, and the machine acknowledged this. As they observed the orb, the system mentioned that it only needed the right time for the awakening. The machine questioned whether the emergence was linked to Cheng Dale's soul, and inquired about the origin of the second fairy. The system speculated that it might be linked to the power of the fate of the Great Empire or incarnated by that empire. The Descending Jade Village started rebuilding their meeting hall. The remaining members had to engage in building up their spirit, and their defense facility also needed improvement. Lastly, Cheng Dalei left behind men from Taman leading 500 people to guard the Descending Jade Village. From on, the Descending Jade Village formally became Toad Village's ally horse ranch, a place especially to train cavalry. A beep from the system notified that 180 remaining people from Descending Jade Village joined Toad Village's population, 5011. In the evening at Toad Village, Xiao Yi pushed Cheng Dalei inside, urging him to go in quickly as Su Ying was waiting for him. While Liu Zhai was there and called Cheng Dalei, she murmured to him, suggesting that Su Ying appeared upset and proposed that if he didn't feel happy. Seducingly, she suggested that he could stay overnight in her room, which was next door and quite big. 
Cheng Dalei was so attracted by her proposal that he could not respond. Shortly after, Cheng Dalei entered Su Ying's room and called for her. Despite not meeting or keeping in contact for months, Cheng Dalei unexpectedly felt a sense of estrangement towards Su Ying. Embarrassed, he commented that she must be tired after a busy day and suggested she warm up her legs and rest early. However, he couldn't shake the feeling that Su Ying, perceptive to the minutest details, there was nothing in the world that could be hidden from her. He realized that, although he unintentionally raised Wanner and Li Hua's favorability a little too much, he hadn't asked himself honestly, as he did not even exceed half a step and did not do anything wrong towards her. Yet, he felt nervous about seeing her again. Cheng Dale was surprised by Su Ying's sudden hug and her calling his name. When the two were alone, Su Ying no longer had to keep up both the appearance of the Su Clan Association's boss and Su Ying. As Su Ying cried in front of him and expressed how much she missed him, the yearning and emotion that were separated for a few months have finally overflowed from within the heart. Cheng Dale softly called Su Ying's name. He expressed how he also missed her as he hugged her tightly. The moment they embraced, the estranged feeling from both was all but lost, and they shared a night filled with the sounds of love in their room. As the saying absence makes the heart grow fonder held for them. The beep from the system notified Cheng Dale of a long, tiring day. Overhearing the sound of love from Cheng Dale's room, Liu Jai could not help but pout sadly. After their intimate moments, both exhaled heavily. Su Ying inquired about Li Hua, mentioning that she heard from others that Li Hua had captured him to be her husband. Su Ying jokingly questioned if Cheng Dale was not tempted when such a pretty girl took the initiative to deliver herself to him. Awkwardly, Cheng Dale explained that they only met a few times and that he was only interested in Li Hua's ability, as he needed her help with something. Su Ying responded playfully, suggesting that it didn't seem to be just that, and he was a good husband. Cheng Dale mentioned that their shared experiences of life and death might have given birth to some strange feelings, especially considering the intense emotions of a feisty lady from the prairie usually had more intense emotion. Chuckled, Su Ying asked him if he liked Li Hua, proposing that he could bring her into his room if he was interested. Cheng Dale was about to react, but Su Ying continued, stating that having one more person to take care of him when he was outside fighting would give her peace of mind at home. Awkwardly, Cheng Dale swore upon heaven that he no romantic feelings toward Li Hua, expressing his satisfaction with Su Ying and Liu Jai. Su Ying stated that they were already spouses, and there was no need to discuss such things. Cheng Dale called her attention and explained that they had been joining and separating many times from Qin New Mountain to Jingzhu and to Qin Chuan. He suggested waiting until they were settled down before making any decisions, emphasizing that they couldn't forget things again. Su Ying questioned him about the thing. He declared to remake the wedding and formally welcome her into the family. After that conversation, they made love again, and Cheng Dale acquired another beep after a long, tiring day. In the other room, Liu Jai commented that she couldn't fall asleep, as she felt annoyed and wondered how long they were going to do it. Meanwhile, in the Ring Tribe jurisdiction northwest, dozens of tribes gathered. One person called out Jin Wendao, urging him to do something for them. Jin Wendao, curious, asked what was wrong. The man informed Jin Wendao that this month's iron ore shipment was the responsibility of their western Yan tribe, but there was an accident on the way this time. Jin Wendao, intrigued, inquired if they lost the goods. The man's name was Wu Simu and revealed that he was fortunate that the goods were brought back, but only a few dozen people returned alive from Kinchuan. Jin Wendao inquired about who was responsible. Wu Simu explained that the mountain bandit Lihua whom he kept an eye on at the Kinchuan border, noted that he asked his men to propose marriage. However, Li Hua not only refused but also joined forces with another mountain bandit to kill all his men. Jin Wendao criticized his men, calling them trash for not being able to handle one village. He asked him how many men he needed. Wu Simu requested 2,000 heavy cavalry from Jin Wendao, expressing his desire to crush the village. Calmly sipping his tea, Jin Wendao questioned the need for such a large army and asked about the village that required such forces. Wu Simu clarified that it wasn't just any village. Cheng Dale had appeared and led the people of Toad Village to kill all his men. Jin Wendao was so surprised that he coughed and almost choked on his drink. Wu Simu expressed concern, and Jin Wendao, after recovering, asked again if he heard correctly about Toad Village and Cheng Dale. Wu Simu confirmed it, emphasizing that Cheng Dale was carrying an ordinary sword, leaving no room for doubt. Deep in thought, Jin Wendao cursed himself and pondered how Cheng Dale appeared in Kinchuan. He cautioned Wu Simu not to be reckless and emphasized the need for careful consideration in the long run. Enraged, Wu Simu questioned why Jin Wendao wanted to take so much time to think about it. 
asking if Jin Wendao was not interested in avenging his people. Serious in his warning, Jin Wendao explained to Wu Simu that provoking Cheng Dale was not a good idea. He emphasized the critical nature of the current time in the fight for the throne, urging Wu Simu to avoid causing extra trouble. Wu Simu was about to say something, but Jin Wendao cut him off, suggesting that he behave these days and not cause trouble during the major event. Wu Simu confirmed it and expressed that he dared not cause trouble. Jin Wendao dismissed him. Despite the advice, Wu Simu seemed reluctant as he contemplated his feelings toward Cheng Dale and expressed his determination not to let him go. Jin Wendao became depressed while he silently poured his tea. He contemplated and questioned how the ungrateful Wu Simu managed to attract Cheng Dale just for a woman. Irritated, he felt that the situation was too familiar, considering what might happen if Cheng Dale became angry and attempted to assassinate him during the coronation. Fearful, he decided that he needed to eliminate the lurking threat in advance and promptly called someone. He quickly ordered his men to pass on his command to send someone to take care of Wu Simu of the Western Yan tribe and ensure they didn't stir up trouble. His men confirmed his order. A few days later, in descending Jade Village, someone in their watchtower spotted the approaching enemy and exclaimed that it was not good, the rings were coming. Upon receiving the information, someone urged everyone to prepare for the incoming attack, and the sound of drums echoed through the village. Lihua and Kin Man observed the ring tribe. Lihua questioned why there were only a dozen of them, and Kin Man realized that the leader seemed to have something to say. The leader of the ring tribe respectfully announced that they were ordered by Jin Wendao. He presented items to them, explaining that he was sent by Jin Wendao to apologize for the actions of their tribesmen the other day. The supplies were offered as a token of appreciation, and he politely asked them to accept them. Li Hu was skeptical, Kin Man was in disbelief, and others in the village questioned why the ring tribe had dropped off the stuff and left. Li Hu pointed out that this group of ring clan had yielded. After another half-month passed, Kin Man assumed the role of an instructor, and the gathered men from the two villages began to show the spirit of a team. Li Hu was responsible for training the cavalry, and a heavy cavalry unit was slowly forming. At the same time, Linner also came to Toad Village to raise horses along with Lihua. Lihua reflected that all the village work was now on the right track. She observed that communication between the two villages was getting closer, and with a sly grin, she considered that it might be time to carry out her poaching plan. She laughed and mentioned Cheng Dale's name as she jokingly stated that he couldn't escape. Fan Lihua taught them what Sun Tzu said in his Art of War, knowing yourself and your enemy allows you to fight and win a hundred battles, which she laughed hysterically. She called out her mother and Fan Yuer and told them that she was overseeing the descending Jade Village and had no time to spare, so she decided that she would send them to live in the Toad Village, for their safety, while she paused as she mentioned for the second reason. She went on to say the other reason, that she would need their help in collecting information about Cheng Dale, her husband, leaving Fan Yuer to excitedly say that she would work hard for the sake of her lifelong happiness, while her mother realized her daughter had finally enlightened. Meanwhile, in Toad Village, Fan Li Hua told Cheng Dale that she would put her family in his place, and that he would have to care for them as if they were his own mother and sister. Fan Yuer addressed Cheng Dale as her brother-in-law, prompting Cheng Dale to laugh and ask her not to refer to him as her brother-in-law, before telling Fan Li Hua not to worry. After a while, Fan Yuer hummed as she ventured into Toad Village. She realized it was big and wondered who she should ask first. She believed she should ask first in a random place with a large number of people. A large crowd gathered and asked Fan Yuer if she wanted to inquire about Cheng Dale's past, on which Fan Yuer agreed, telling them that she loved hearing heroic stories and wondered if they could tell her the story of Cheng Dale. Fan Yuer was disappointed because one of the people told her that he arrived late at the Toad Village, while the others were the same and told her they couldn't help her. She inquired as to who could tell her about Cheng Dale's past. They informed her that she could go to the senior brothers, which piqued her interest, and asked if they could introduce her to them. Lai Ojia informed her that Cheng Dale would always say things that they didn't understand while Lao Yi added that he would also do things that surprised people, and Huang Sanyuan stated that he developed the Toad Village with only a few people into a powerful village that could resist the Ring Tribe's main forces of 100,000, leaving Fan Yuer in awe. In other places, Yi told her that Cheng Dale could always make strange things, and that she could get a lot of inspiration from the many things he had done. Meanwhile, Zhang Fei informed her that Cheng Dale was a disciple of the South Pole Immortal, claiming that an immortal was assisting him although most people didn't believe him, and Gao Fei Bao stated that they couldn't help it, they easily get along, eat and drink together, making Cheng Dale didn't look immortal because he was too easygoing. 
Princess Minjiu asked her if she wanted to know about Cheng Dale, and Fan Yuer nodded. Princess Minjiu looked down and crunched the book she held. She informed her that Cheng Dale was an asshole, a bastard, and a leecher. Fan Yuer noticed Princess Minjiu's temper was so similar to her sister Fan Li Hua scolding Cheng Dale, and she wondered if they were the same shy. She also thought she seemed to be a potential rival of her sister, and since she couldn't ask anything, she reasoned that she'd better go and ask someone else. She came across him and asked if he was Zhao Zilong. Zhao Zilong inquired as to who she was and what she wanted. Fan Yuer blushed as her mind went blank, realizing that he was so attractive and claimed to be her type. She became shy as she admitted to him that she was not talented and apologized for bothering him before later asking if he was married, which confused Zhao Zilong. Fan Yuer wondered what she was doing, that after roaming around for a long time, all she asked were useless things. She sighed, thinking that she would have to stay for a few more days because she was unfamiliar with the place. She was perplexed when she noticed something. Fan Yuer wondered if the structure she was at was a medical center. She remembered what she heard that the medical center's doctor was also an old senior brother. She decided to go in and ask, and knocked on the door to find out if anyone was there. She entered and greeted Liu Bei, saying she wanted to talk to him, which caused Liu Bei to question her. Liu Bei inquired what she wanted to talk about and invited her to come and sit down. Fan Yuer agreed, realizing Liu Bei was so young and wondering how he became the head of the medical center at such a young age, as well as noticing that he seemed to emit an extraordinary aura. It was such a beautiful day, but it almost became a shadow that Fan Yuer could never forget for the rest of her life. Another day of hard work at the Toad Village blacksmith shop, as someone yelled at the workers, encouraging them to work harder and wishing them all the best. Mu Changzheng had been promoted to blacksmith shop steward due to his hard work. Someone thanked them for their hard work and promised to see them again tomorrow. Mu Changzheng entered the house as night fell. He rested in his bed, grumbling about another long day. He paused for a little while and said nothing. He realized something and screamed in disagreement. Mu Changzheng's face darkened as he realized he came there for a purpose other than to become an outstanding blacksmith. He told himself that he couldn't go on like that and he had to get moving. Mu Changzheng read his Toad Village Infiltration Diary, which started in August as he successfully infiltrated the Toad Village and was assigned to the blacksmith shop while he wished for Mo Mingmi to bless him to complete the mission. Some days later, he wrote that in eight hours of forging, he expressed that life's great hardships were honestly not to deceive him. Forging, boating, and grinding soybeans. And as for September, Mu Changzheng wrote that he was forging and he seemed to have lost some weight. In the following days, he wrote that the Toad Village attacked the descending Jade Village, and only civilian workers were left in the village, believing that it was the best opportunity to attack. However, they came back in half a day, and he had no choice but to give up. At the end of September, he stated that he was forging and he had not taken a month off. However, the food was delicious, and he could still hold up. He started the month of October stating that he was an attentive person, and even if he were smithing, he could still make achievements. That day he was promoted to become the blacksmith shop steward, which made him happy. The next day, he was forging iron, and whenever he saw the admiring eyes of his brothers and heard their praises of Zhu Shenji, he felt that his whole body was inexhaustible and more energetic when he picked up and swung the sledgehammer. He ended October stating that he was happy working as a blacksmith. He read what he wrote in November, which was that he was just forging. In the next few days, he realized he had a more important mission and had not come to do smithing. He continued reading as his diary stated that his purpose was to spy on the Toad Village and gather information or assassinate Cheng Dale, realizing that was his real purpose. The following day he expressed that Cheng Dale couldn't see through it, realizing that it seemed there was no chance as he could only start from Zhu Shenji. Mu Chengzheng became depressed as he continued reading complimenting Zhu Shenji for how wise he was and wondering how he could implement his plan into action. He could only wait for the opportunity and continue on smithing while he ended the month of November with him just forging. Meanwhile, early in the morning, at the blacksmith shop, workers were taken aback when they noticed the steward come so early, while a clanging noise echoed. Mu Chengzheng set his goals, and if he had the strength to do so, he would exert his body to do something. As Mu Changjin continued his work, one of the workers stated that he was worthy of being a steward because not everyone could have that much strength. Zhu Shenji praised Mu Changjin, telling him that the performance of the blacksmith shop depended on him, and Mu Changjin replied that he was overpraising. A few days later, the sun set and the moon rose. Someone greeted Zhu Shenji, expressing his relief that he had finally arrived. Mu Changjin informed him that he lived in a simple environment and hoped he didn't mind. 
Mu Changzheng also stated that he had specially prepared him good wine, as well as fried dishes, to treat him, causing Zhu Shenji to chuckle and ask him why he bothered. Mu Changzheng invited him to hurry up and take a seat and told him that he could now have this achievement because of his favors. He insisted on going on and stated that he would drink first. Zhu Shenji felt at ease when he saw that they drank the same jar of wine and ate the same dish, prompting him to say that Mu Changzheng was unusually humble and fond of learning. Mu Changzheng inquired of Zhu Shenji whether he believed their village would be attacked by others. Zhu Shenji's face flushed as he thought it was good wine, and he responded to Mu Changzheng, urging them to come if they wanted to fight as there would be nothing to fear because of Cheng Dalei. Surprised, Mu Changzheng asked if Cheng Dalei had a method, and Zhu Shenji agreed. He informed him that he came to the Toad Village because of Cheng Dalei's reputation provoking Zhu Shenji to tell him how capable Cheng Dalei was, and Zhu Shenji to question him if he knew where Cheng Dalei's abilities came from. Mu Chengzheng asked him if he could enlighten him, and Zhu Shenji replied that an immortal had imparted a skill on Cheng Dalei in a dream. Mu Chengzheng stated that he had heard people talking about what he said and wondered if there was really an immortal in the world, which Zhu Shenji called him out, telling him that he did not believe it at the beginning. As he grew old watching over Cheng Dalei, he claimed that he was quite ordinary in all aspects. He also informed him that after the death of the old village master, Cheng Dalei became like a new person, with more knowledge and understanding, and he also learned immortal technique. Wu Changjin wondered if it was true, and Su Shenji told him that it was far more than true, and more real than real gold. Zhu Shenji mentions the Five Thunder Method, the summoning of wind and rain, and scattering beans into soldiers. He clarifies that he saw it with his own eyes and could never lie to him. Mu Changzheng had a thought that the last time the 18 lieutenants attacked, the people who escaped said that Zhu Shenji was standing on a high platform, while from what he heard from Zhu Shenji was different, so he wondered why he put all the credit on Cheng Dalei. He realizes something. He believes Zhu Shenji was trying to make himself hidden behind the scenes while making Cheng Dalei's reputation louder, just like when the forest was beautiful and the wind would destroy it. He claims that Zhu Shenji seemed to be ordinary, but when he looked carefully, he saw a man of true talent who never shows off and who didn't need to show his true colors. Mu Changzheng chuckles and asks Zhu Shenji if no one could break through their village. As he sipped his bowl, he states that it couldn't be better while feeling agonized, as the bitter wine in his throat hurts, and wondering who knew his sadness. Zhu Shenji chuckles and responds that he couldn't think of a way if it was someone else, but he's different from them, which puzzles Mu Changzheng. He informs him that as the village master's strategist, he had to think for his well-being no matter the situation, and that he had been thinking hard these days about how he would break through the village, and when he thought of the way, he naturally had a way to pull it off. Mu Changzheng is taken aback because it would be natural for Zhu Shenji to find a weakness in the village defenses, so he asks him if he had thought of a way. Zhu Shenji agrees but stops mid-sentence as he was about to tell him. He realizes he can't tell Mu Changzheng because he was a bastard. He scoffs at him, telling him why he should tell him about it when they're just going to drink. Mu Changzheng realizes how close he is, and after what he had just asked that had Zhu Shenji on alert. He claims that he couldn't be reckless, and that he needed to take it step by step in order to coax him to talk. He laughs, informing Zhu Shenji that he didn't understand what he was saying because he had less knowledge. He tells Zhu Shenji that they're going to keep drinking. Mu Changzheng laughs and tells him that they're going to drink and not talk about work. As the night grows darker, his voice echoes outside, inviting Zhu Shenji to carry on drinking and praising him for being a great drinker. After three rounds of wine and five different dishes, Zhu Shenji prompts him to go faster and informs him that he had a strong alcohol tolerance, and he could drink as much as he could. Zhu Shenji drank his bowl, causing him to burp from time to time, while telling Mu Changjing if he knew how the 100,000 heavy cavalry of the Ring tribe was defeated by the spell he cast, as he summoned the water from the river and flooded the 100,000 Ring tribe. Mu Changjing's eyes widened as Zhu Shenji admitted that he did it, surprised at how the alcohol could make one speak the truth. He addressed Zhu Shenji, inquiring about his opinion on where they should start to break through their village. Zhu Shenji burped and asked what he meant. Mu Changjing slapped the table and inquired how to break through the village. He stood up and addressed it as their village. Mu Changjing's face darkened, asking Zhu Shenji what he feared most. Tipsy, Zhu Shenji repeated what he said. He imagined Cheng Dalei who was nearly burned to death, instructing them to pile up a lot of firewood and pay attention to the fire because it was a very hot day. Zhu Shenji whispered that he feared fire, making Mu Changzhen confused about his answer. He reiterated his fear of fire and paused after informing him on how to break through the village using fire. 
Wu Chengjin's face stiffened as he gained the knowledge to use fire to break through the village. He repeatedly mumbled what he had said as Zhu Shenji slept in front of him. Zhu Shenji grumbled in his sleep as Mu Chengzheng realized that with just eight words, a bowl broke down to the ground, which made a clunking noise. Mu Chengzheng thought that the mystery had been solved, and he no longer had to stay in the village. He believed that in order to get those eight words, he had waited so long, endured and suffered so much that he couldn't even look back as he expressed his relief by stating how beautiful the sight would be when the village fell into the sea of fire. Mu Chengzhen cried as he realized that he succeeded. Meanwhile at the Kinchuan Pass, Mo Mingmi asked his advisor if there was any news from Mu Chengzheng's side, as he believed that it was more than two months. The advisor told him there was nothing yet and wondered if he blew his cover. Mo Mingmi assumed that no news was sometimes good news, meaning that he wasn't exposed yet. A soldier informed Mo Mingmi that someone crawled over. Mo Mingmi yelled, asking the man who he was, while the man gasped in exhaustion. Wu Chengzheng lifted himself up and called out to Mo Mingmi. He informed him that he was back, as he ran like crazy for a day and a night. Mo Mingmi ordered his men to go get him as he realized that it was Mu Chengzheng. After a while, someone reported that Mu Chengzheng was awake. Mo Mingmi inquired if he found out anything. Mu Chengzheng reported that it was fortunate that the task he entrusted to him finally got completed, and he informed him that the news came from Zhu Shenji's mouth. The military advisor was taken aback and asked if it was the man known as the Miracle of Foresight Jade Face Zhu Shenji. While Mo Mingmi inquired as to where he found such an outstanding person, Mu Chengzheng informed them that he also knew Zhu Shenji was very outstanding and decided not to reveal the matter in front of him, and that he was able to elicit the method for breaking the village from him because he gained his trust and got him drunk last night. The military advisor wondered why Zhu Shenji from the Toad Village would think of ways to break into his own village. Mu Chengzheng responded that there were things that ordinary people, aside from military strategists, did not know. He also mentioned that, according to Zhu Shenji, you could only defend yourself if you knew how the enemy would attack. The military advisor realized that it was indeed the case, leading Mo Mingmi to believe that his intelligence was not even close to that of Zhu Shenji. Mo Mingmi inquired of Mu Chengzheng as to what Zhu Shenji had said, and he replied that he only said eight words. Mu Chengzheng stated that to break through the village, they needed to use fire. Both Mo Mingmi and the military advisor were stunned. Someone expressed himself about the subject. The military advisor disagreed that it wasn't a good idea, reminding Mu Chengzheng that the Toad Village was on an island. He explained that it was surrounded by water, and water vapor was abundant, and with fire, they would get half the results with twice the effort. Mo Mingmi assumed that Zhu Shenji already knew his identity, and decided to deliberately use those words to deceive by luring them into a trap. Mu Chengzheng, on the other hand, claimed that if it was a trap, he would have said a more realistic trick, but he believed that the plan for the fire attack appeared unreliable but was true. Mo Mingmi thought it made sense, but he was uncertain about how he should execute the fire attack plan. The military advisor argued that the fire attack on the toad village on the island was too impractical unless large quantities of kerosene, sulfur, and gunpowder were used. He also mentioned that the cost was huge, and if it went wrong, it would be very bad for them, advising Mo Mingmi to be careful, which made Mo Mingmi realize that what he said was also true. Mu Chengzheng asked Mo Mingmi if he could ask a question and if they knew what toadstool was and what Zhu Shenji did. He wondered if they could compare themselves to Zhu Shenji when it comes to the sharpness of vision and cleverness of strategy. The military advisor said something about the subject, and he readily acknowledged his defeat to Zhu Shenji. Mu Chengzheng stated that he guaranteed it, that the fire attack plan from Zhu Shenji when he was drunk was the Toad Village's weakness, and that it was just that with their intelligence, they couldn't keep up with his thought process yet. He also informed them that once he was gone, Zhu Shenji would be on alert, as things have to move quickly, and if he became cautious, he believed that they would miss the foolproof opportunity, prompting the military advisor to understand, and stated that now that the answer had been given, it was up to them to solve it. After a while, someone told them to come on and ready the sandbox, as they would be staying up all night to discuss the plan. The military advisor explained to them that the boat dock at Toad Village was built on an open area along the river and a large amount of wood was piled. He believed that those places were perfect for fire attacks. He went on to say that if they first burned down the boat dock, they would lose their ability to fight on the water and would be unable to retreat, and Mo Mingmi added that they would retreat to the mountain village to hold it. The military advisor claimed that they would use a large amount of gunpowder to cause a forest fire destroying the mountain forest and forcing them to abandon the defensive city and escape the mountain village. 
He also stated that the boat docks, grain elevators, and gunpowder stores were the most important strategic targets, and that they would concentrate their army with big ships from the opposite direction and attack in one breath. The military advisor told them that forcing them to engage in physical combat on the island plain was unnecessary because they only needed to start a war on flat land, and with their superior strength, the rest would be easy. He informed Mo Mingni that his plan would cause forest fires the fastest because he believed that a small fire was no way to drive them out of the village. He also claimed that their soldiers were very fast, and that they would prepare lots of sulfur, gunpowder, kerosene, and other fire-starting materials the next day. The military advisor requested Mo Mingmi to personally lead the army the following day and dispatch 10,000 men to attack Toad Village, confident it would be a sure win. Mo Mingmi commended him for the excellent plan, causing the military advisor to sigh in exhaustion and conclude that Zhu Shenji had provided him with the answer, and he spent the night contemplating solutions. He chuckled, thinking that the gap between him and Zhu Shenji was not as significant as he thought. He scoffed, asserting that it would not be possible for him to defeat Zhu Shenji at scheming. As the morning sun rose, Zhu Shenji approached Cheng Dalei with bad news. He stuttered as he mentioned the traitor, and Cheng Dalei told him enough because he already knew what happened. Cheng Dalei stated that the mole was one of Mo Mingmi's people, whom he expected to attack them because he knew he would personally lead 10,000 men, plus 5,000 men of the 18 lieutenants who should arrive tomorrow, as he read the latest information Yun Zhonglong had brought back to him. Zhu Shenji, on the other hand, argued that what he wanted to say was that he learned this morning that the traitor Zhang Kang had disappeared because he was drunk for a whole day and night. Cheng Dalei cursed Zhu Shenji on his thought, claiming that he was just as useless as always because he only now realized that Zhang Kang had disappeared while others had already run back to report information and were already on their way with soldiers. He asked him if he had not told Zhang Kang anything important and Zhu Shenji denied telling him that he always kept an eye on him and said nothing, which made Cheng Dalei feel relieved because the terrain of Snake Island should be familiar to him, but he believed that if they were pushed onto the island by them, it would be a problem. He told him to inform the whole village to prepare for war. The next day, countless ships were seen at the sea. Someone informed Mo Mingmi that they would arrive at Toad Village in 10 miles. Mo Mingmi chuckled, claiming that that day was just right for a fire attack, as the sky was clear, and the sun was high in the sky. He also stated that the northwest wind would support them, and that the wind would give power to fire, causing it to get even stronger, believing that Toad Village would stand in a sea of fire, and Mu Chengzheng also believed that the god wanted to kill Cheng Dalei too. Mo Mingmi laughed, assuring Mu Chengzheng that if the fight would be successful he would get the first credit. Someone yelled that it was the Toad Village's boat dock, while another said that they would begin the breakthrough with a fire attack claiming that while they were putting out the fire, they would take the shore and kill and set fire to everyone. Meanwhile, at the shore, someone yelled at everyone informing others that the enemies were coming, stating that they actually decided to send their entire force to attack them, and ordered their men to hurry up and fire the signal to prepare to meet the enemy. Back at the sea, someone ordered them to beat the drums and told everyone to prepare. As the military advisor informed them about the downwind, a loud drum noise was heard. He instructed them to ignite and string the bow. He waved his flag and ordered the archers to release the arrows. Burning arrows flew in the sky making whooshing noise. As the people on the shore warned everyone to be careful because those were fire arrows, others advised them to shield up, and someone was concerned that the fire arrows hit the woodpile. The villagers went into panic as the boat dock caught fire, telling each other to quickly organize people to put out the fire, and realizing that the wood was dry as it burned when it touched an open fire. Cheng Dalei and Zhu Shenji directed everyone to bring the injured back to the village first and watch out for the arrows, as well as to put out the fire as quickly as possible, which made Cheng Dalei think that it would be troublesome to let those traders dominate the topography of their village. He believed that it would be a problem if they were to have a large amount of gunpowder at any price. He wondered who gave them the idea and Zhu Shenji informed him that if it did not work out, they had to give up the place. People yelled that the grain store was full of wood, while the warehouse on the right was also on fire, and others noticed the fire in the back. Cheng Dalei reasoned that they took advantage of the village's disadvantage because their firefighting measures were not yet perfect. He slashed at the incoming arrows with his explosive fireworks technique. Zhu Shenji was taken aback and asked Cheng Dalei what he was doing, and he replied so they could get a broader view and the people underneath could see his command. 
Cheng Dalei grabbed a flag and told Zhu Shenji to use it and help him organize firefighting efforts. He reminded him that the dock should not be destroyed as it took so much manpower and resources. Zhu Shenji accepted command of the firefighting effort and asked Cheng Dalei what he intended to do. Cheng Dalei stated that he was responsible for keeping the arrows away from him, as he believed that his personal safety was important, which made Zhu Shenji chuckle in agreement. He also mentioned that he had to do something on the way there, prompting Zhu Shenji to inquire what he had to do. Cheng Dalei replied that he would call the wind, and Hart continued it by summoning the rain. Above, Hart foresaw what was happening. She raised her hand, claiming that the Toad Village meteorologist had reminded them that the weather had changed from sunny to heavy rain and that they should bring an umbrella. Someone stated that in ancient times, there was the Battle of Poyang Lake, and now there was the Battle of Toad Village, which he did not expect. He expected the island to be surrounded by water, the land to be wet, and the fire attack to be half as successful with half the double effort, and claimed that the island turned out to be covered in foliage for a long time, and there were dead branches all over the mountain. He went on to say that it was also because Toad Village was constantly under construction, causing the wood to pile up like a mountain. The man claimed that the fire was indeed a wonderful way to break through the village. Mu Chengzheng informed Mo Mingmi that the fire had grown so big that people were starting to panic, and Mo Mingmi told him to prepare to board the island and land on the beach. The military advisor was astounded that Zhu Shenji had grasped even the smallest details, prompting him to praise him as brilliant. However, he was saddened at Zhu Shenji and stated that he made a bad move that allowed them to seize the opportunity. He giggled hysterically as the fire engulfed the boat docks of Toad Village. The military advisor was confused about what he noticed. He wondered if it was Cheng Dalei, while the person next to him was Zhu Shenji. He was confused about what they were doing, assuming that Zhu Shenji was commanding them to put out the fire while waving the black flag. The military advisor explained that the five-colored flag was used to give orders in the army, while the black flag indicated the appearance of water ahead. Meanwhile, Hart instructed the clouds to gather. Countless thunder rumbled down the sky. The thunder rumbled while Mo Mingmi's army's arrows continued to fly. The military advisor was puzzled as he looked up. Then suddenly rain came pouring down when Hart stated that the last would be when there was rain falling. Rain dropped on the face of the military advisor, making him realize that it was raining. Mu Changjin wondered if it was raining, and Mo Mingmi wondered what was going on as well. Heavy rain shocked the soldiers. While the villagers were ecstatic and told each other that it was raining, others assumed that it looked like a rainstorm. One of the villagers laughed as the rain just came in time. Zhu Shenji told Chen Dalei that the rain was too unnatural and wondered if he had used his power again. And Cheng Dalei responded that it was all thanks to his second brother. Mo Mongmi, on the other hand, was enraged and demanded to know what the hell was going on, causing Mu Chengzheng to struggle to respond. He wondered if he could set a fire in that weather wondering who said to use a fire attack. And Mu Changzheng responded that he remembered Zhu Shenji said that he had the ability to summon the wind and rain. Mo Mingmi wondered what he talked about and if he thought of him as stupid. Mu Changzheng argued that what he said was true and that he would not deceive him. And the military advisor asked Mo Mingmi not to blame him for the battle. Mo Mingmi addressed the military advisor by name but did not finish what he said. Depressed, the military advisor appeared to be a completely different person. His heroic spirit was gone. His hair had withered, and the entire person appeared to have aged several years, and he informed Mo Mingmi that the method of fire was correct. He claimed that the rain came in a strange way, and Mo Mingmi responded that the rain was not only strange but also had the appearance of a monster wreaking havoc. According to the military advisor, when the Ring tribe attacked the Toad Village, they also encountered such strange heavy rain. He originally thought it was just a superstitious rumor and thought of competing with strategist Zhu Shenji in Stratagem, which he didn't expect. The difference between him was already the difference between immortal and mortal. He believed that mortals could not defeat heaven and claimed that Zhu Shenji had seen through nature's mystery. Zhu Shenji asked Cheng Dalei if he could stop his magic power because his old bones couldn't stand the heavy rain, and Cheng Dalei assured him that he would take him down. Cheng Dalei wrapped him around his arms as he leaped the tower, making Zhu Shenji scream. Mo Mingmi realized that they disappeared. Then suddenly the rain gradually slowed. Hart chuckled and stated that it had been a long time since she had been active, so she decided to give them something big. Then suddenly a strong wind blew. Soldiers yelled at each other as the wind blew and shifted to a headwind. They warned each other that the wind and rain were getting stronger, while someone told them to take control of the boat and take the helm, and others warned them to be careful because the wind direction had changed. Someone ordered them to quickly lower the sail because the wind and waves were strong, reminding them to watch out for the torrent. 
The boat began to rumble as they realized that the fleet was too dense and they would collide if they kept going like that. Mo Mingmi's troops faced a crushing defeat before they even came face to face with the enemy. And in front of this heavenly power, 15,000 soldiers abandoned their armor, and finally, many of them fell into the water. Mo Mingmi, Mu Chengzheng, and the military advisor struggled to survive. Mo Mingmi looked up, astounded that there was such a strange person in the Toad Village as Zhu Shenji. As he accepted defeat as God's will, a massive tornado formed, and someone informed them that the military advisor had fallen into the water. Then a system prescript appeared, stating that after the battle, Zhu Shenji became famous throughout the world, and he was later included in the record of the Book of the World's Strange People. The storm lasted only a few hours, but it seemed as if a super typhoon landed for months. The river rose by one meter, and a mission notification popped up, stating that the mission to defend the village was three-tenth progress. Soldiers dangled from a floating wood in the sea, as if dead. Someone told Cheng Dalei that his second brother was really powerful, claiming that the storm shattered lots of Mo Mingmi's soldiers and lieutenants. Cheng Dalei instructed Zhu Shenji to lead their brothers to arrest those who washed up on the shore, and Zhu Shenji agreed. He praised Hart for playing a big game this time and advised her not to exhaust herself like she did the last time. He told her to take it easy, and Hart responded that she didn't have to play when the second sprite came out. She laughed and told Cheng Dale that it was her last time playing with water, so she had to have some fun. Cheng Dale claimed that Mo Mingmi had bad luck because his rice was looking for trouble. He wondered who gave him the idea to use the fire attack and asked Zhu Shenji if he knew anything. But Zhu Shenji had the same question. After a while, at the Toad Village, Martial Arts Arena, Cheng Dale addressed the captive soldiers. He told them that Mo Mingmi had committed a lot of evil, and this time, they were all innocent people affected by the heavenly wrath of the immortals. He viewed all of their information, assuring them that he would send them off after a while. However, before they go, they have to give him some information about Kinchuan Mountain. The information was gathered in such a way that it appeared they were all ordinary soldiers, with the exception of the top military advisor, which caused Cheng Dale to wonder. As he viewed the information of the military advisor, Yan Dai, 40 years old, who accompanied Mo Mingmi to attack the Toad Village, he realized he had accidentally caught a big fish. He greeted Yan Dai and said it was a pleasure to meet him. Yan Dai was surprised and wondered how he recognized him. He realized that it was Zhu Shenji. Who was staring at him. Zhu Shenji was perplexed, as Yan Dai felt relieved that he had been seen through by him, claiming that losing in the hands of Zhu Shenji was not so bad. Mo Mingmi was greatly weakened after the battle, prompting Cheng Dale to take the initiative to send someone to negotiate between the two sides. Along with military advisor Yan Dai, a man inquired about the non-aggression treaty as well as a trade route. Lieutenant Zhu asked Liu Bei who he thought he was and if he still wanted to be on an equal footing with Mo Mingmi. Liu Bei denied and stated that the question was not whether the Toad Village was worthy but rather whether Mo Mingmi was qualified to sit on an equal footing with them. Negotiations between the two sides continued for several days, using the prisoners of the battle as bargaining chips. And finally, both sides signed a non-aggression treaty and divided their spheres of influence, and the portion Cheng Dale got included three lieutenants and a trade route. In any case, Cheng Dale and Mo Mingmi maintained the apparent peace, though it was feared that it would not last long this time. Cheng Dale stated that with Su Ying's arrival, he could finally get away from the village chores management and think about the future, and he also realized that he didn't have such a leisurely day for some time. Cheng Dale also stated that there were two flower queens accompanying him, Liu Jihan who had the fragrance lingering, and Yi Jidao who lightly played the music he taught her from his previous life. He claimed that people said the red sleeve fragrance was good for reading, as it was a wise remark of an experienced person. He wrote the things he had to do, which included requesting teachers and carrying out literacy activities, as well as establishing complete rules and regulations, storing grain for winter as his brothers needed to change into thick clothes, and training infantry cavalry. He also wondered about the single brother's problem and had an idea to buy some female slaves. However, he denied it as it was not his style. Cheng Dale realized that he needed to upgrade to a level 3 village, but he realized that the blueprint for a level 3 village could only be obtained after completing the mission. As he viewed his incomplete missions, the first was to upgrade level 3 mountain village, for which he lacked the blueprint. The second was to complete 10 robberies, which he already let Gao Fei Bao and others do, especially robbing the 18 lieutenants. The third was the Red Sky Sword exclusive mission, and the fourth was to defend the village 10 times which Cheng Dale sighed as he realized that there were so many things to do. 
He also stated that there was a mystery about the system, which seemed to be revealed only after the village strength continued to improve. He wondered if the system wanted him to save the world and bring peace to it. And he wondered if it did want him to rob money, food, and women while concentrating on being a mountain king and catching lolis. He also thought if the system wanted him to rule the world and fuck the damn emperor. So he asked Hart, however, she couldn't answer his question. Cheng Dale pondered what he truly wanted and whether it was power, as he hated the official circle, or strength, which Hart said she could give him. He also needed strength, but if he pursued it too far, he believed he would become a monster who only fights and kills. He considered women but claimed that desire without love is nothing more than beastly intercourse or throne. He stated that because Emperor Ming was so weak, he was not particularly interested in the throne of the empire. It would be interesting if he could send Princess Minjiu to the throne, as he was cultivating her. Cheng Dale claimed that none of those were what he wanted, and as the ink from his brush dripped, at that moment, Cheng Dale had no spare energy to do it and wondered if it was the reason why the system wanted him to upgrade the level of the village. He thought that only when one's families and brothers lived a good life could they change the chaotic world. And as he wrote that the poor could only think of oneself, and success could make everyone live a better life, Cheng Dale decided to continue to expand their own power first. Dao Feibao appeared, informing Cheng Dale that he brought back the grains for winter, and Cheng Dale praised him for doing a good job and inquired how many pounds he bought. Gao Feibao informed him that there were more than 300,000 pounds in total and that originally, the 18 lieutenants controlled the rice stores and did not sell them grains. He added that they went to rob them, and that in addition to Yun Zhongluang, they robbed a total of 7 minus 8 lieutenants. A mission notification popped up, stating that the 10 robbery mission was completed 10 over 10, and he was rewarded with a level 3 village blueprint prompting Cheng Dale to commend them for their efficiency. Gao Feibao galloped up on his horse. He rode around town informing everyone that the Toad Village was hiring workers and that those who arrived first would be served first. He went on to say that interested parties could apply at the tea stall outside the city, and people with flyers were given priority. The people inquired about the Toad Village, which was a group of mountain bandits two to three months ago. One guy informed others that it was good to work there, without getting beaten up or scolded, while someone else added that the daily meal was enough and there was meant to eat on occasion, and that the Toad Village people also give salary for work, extra pay, and good treatment, and he could earn some money to help out with his family expenses during the slack season. They began to gossip, with one another asking if there were such good things and wondering why someone was robbing him of his flyers that he picked up, while others told them to hurry up because they didn't know how many people they were hiring believing that it would be gone if they went late, and another asking them to wait because he was also coming. Meanwhile, people arrived one by one, and finally, thousands of people came to apply. Wang Sanyuan informed one of the applicants that they don't accept sneaky slackers. He also told them that they were grouping them according to village and town, and that if one person was lazy, the entire group's wage would be deducted. Then someone asked who dared to fish in troubled waters, and idle on the job, reminding them not to forget where they were. A system notification popped stating that level 3 village was under construction. Meanwhile, in Heijia City, Lakebed Fishing, Su Ying assigned the Lyo brothers to open another restaurant in Heijia City to make money and gather information. One of the 18 lieutenants greeted Cheng Dale, and Cheng Dale invited them to sit because there was no need for them to be cautious because they had already exchanged blows that led to their friendship. He informed them that he negotiated with Mo Mingmi to divide the sphere of influence, and he assigned the three of them to him, and asked the three lieutenants if they knew it, and they agreed. One of the lieutenants asked if they were going to become Mo Mingmi's enemies now that they were following him. Cheng Dale assured them that by following him, they would not suffer because Mo Mingmi used to be in charge, but now that he was here, it was his territory. Yun Zhonglong asked what he wanted them to do for him. Cheng Dale informed them that he asked Mo Mingmi for a trade route so he could use it to do business with the Ring tribe. The other lieutenant informed him that the trade route in the Kinchuan mountain range was dangerous and had ferocious beasts, and later on, the other route was open, so the route was abandoned, and Yun Zhonglong added that there were also other people who had the idea of the trade route in the beginning, and they all died on the road in the end, while the other stated that Mo Mingmi wouldn't give the route so easily. Cheng Dale argued that just because it was a dangerous route didn't mean they couldn't go, otherwise, he couldn't create a monopoly, as he envisioned, and first, they took the herbs, salt, and tea leaves to open up a market. He informed them that he was responsible for the supply of herbs and that they were in charge of the other two, 
and one of them stated that he knew a way to illegally trade salt. Yun Zhonglong stated that he knew a few tea vendors, and the last one knew how to sell for the exchanging of jade and furs. Cheng Dalei was overjoyed and told them to return to prepare the goods, and he would personally lead the team for the first batch of goods. He believed that. Based on what he had found, Mo Mingmi had opened up a trade route for human trafficking ten years ago. He assumed the orphan of the White Snake Master was sold to the Ring Tribe through the trade route, believing he could find her by following the trade route, as he told the three lieutenants to keep a low profile, enter the village quietly, and not shout. Meanwhile, at Mo Mingmi's mansion near the Kinchuan border, someone addressed Mo Mingmi and asked if he truly agreed to sign the agreement. Yin Dai wondered if they would allow Cheng Dalei to go on and if a man as ambitious as him would be willing to sit on an equal footing with them. Mo Mingmi responded that he understood what Yan Dai said and believed that it was better to be silent than to make a move because, after their bizarre defeat, the Kinchuan border was greatly wounded, and the people were scared and had no desire to fight. He went on to say that they had no chance with Zhu Shenji in charge of the Toad Village, and if they wanted to attack, they had to wait for his absence. And Yen Dai argued that the fighting power of the Toad Village was not weak, and even if they wanted to eradicate them, he feared that they would have to pay a great price. Mo Mingmi concluded that they had to borrow troops outside. Yen Dai inquired as to who he desired to borrow troops from and whether it was the Ring Tribe. Mo Mingmi told him that he wanted to borrow troops from Jin Wendu, but he was refused because he was fighting for the throne and didn't have any troops to lend. He accepted that he really couldn't, so Mo Mingmi could only borrow some troops from Minister Kui. Mo Mingmi also expressed concern that Minister Kui would be blamed, asserting that in less than a year, they were forced to borrow troops due to Cheng Dale and Zhu Shenji. Yan Dai reassured him that it wasn't their fault, but that the Toad Village was evil. He directed Yan Dai to deliver the secret letter to Minister Kui and Jinju, as well as inform him that they were going to arrange for someone to take care of the trade route that Cheng Dalei wanted. Yan Dai agreed, and just as Cheng Dalei was preparing to open the trade route, Zhu Shenji asked someone if she wanted to know what happened between Cheng Dalei and Su Ying in the past. He assured her that she was asking the right person because he witnessed how Cheng Dalei got Su Ying's heart back then. He informed her that he saw Cheng Dale sneaking into Su Ying's room to leave a small note, and he took a look at it. The letter stated that the content of the letter was Cheng Dale just wanted to do four things with her and have three meals a day. Zhu Shenji had been thinking for a long time that it wasn't just a simple four things and eating. After a while at the descending Jade Village, Fan Li Hua's mother reported what he heard from Zhu Shenji. Fan Li Hua then assumed Cheng Dale liked those. The next day at the Toad Village, someone informed the madam that the descending Jade Village had sent a letter that stated that it must be handed over to Cheng Dale. Su Ying told the man to hand it to her, and the man agreed. Su Ying opened the letter and read its content. The letter stated that as the night deepened, she lay and listened to winds buffeting the rain, and iron-clad horses over frozen rivers came charging into her dreams. She woke up and fell deeply in love with him, as there were only four things she wanted to do with him, and three meals a day. The day before she found out that she liked him, today, and tomorrow she would like him very much. Su Ying's hands trembled. She blushed, wondering why Fan Lihua was taking the initiative, and if she knew what shame was. Fan Lihua thought that she wrote a lot of letters, but they all sank in the sea. She heard that women chased men's interlayer yarn and wondered if Cheng Dale would occupy his own village and completely put her aside, claiming that with his nature it wouldn't be impossible, which made her depressed as she was not his worker. She considered learning from those young ladies who embroidered a scented bag for their lover, but Fan Yue rushed in, calling her sister. Fan Yue showed her how she found out the key information from the Toad Village. She informed her that, according to what she found, Cheng Dale had a flat wife named Liu Jihan in addition to the legal wife Su Ying, and that, at first, Liu Jihan was treated the same as her, until they arrived in Jingju. She continued to explain to Fan Lihua, which made Fan Lihua blush and ask her what she said. Fan Yue ecstatically cheered for her sister, believing that the method would work since Liu Jihan had succeeded. She told Fan Lihua that she was an outstanding woman, unlike those who lacked the strength to kill a chicken in comparison to those young ladies. She went on to say that the grassland girls could love and hate boldly because there was nothing to be embarrassed about because they were just getting married. Fan Lihua cheered up, stating that if she liked a man, she must grab him, and there was no need for her to be annoyed. She dashed out, instructing someone to prepare her a horse and a jar of good wine. And as the sun rose up, Meanwhile, at the Toad Village, Cheng Dale read a book. Someone invited Cheng Dale to a drink. Cheng Dale asked Fan Lihua what brought her there, telling her that he had planned to visit her but had been busy and had not found a good time yet. 
but he was glad she came, and Fan Lihua replied that she was not here for any other purpose than to have a drink with him. Cheng Dale awkwardly smiled, wondering if she was being a jerk again and why she had suddenly come towards him for a drink. While informing Fan Lihua that he was not a heavy drinker, and would prefer not to drink. Fan Lihua fumed and stabbed her knife at the table. She let him choose between drinking and dueling her, which caused Cheng Dale to struggle to answer to drink. Fan Lihua told him she had been thinking for a long time, and it was her business that she liked him, even though she knew he didn't like her back, so she wouldn't force him. She sprinkled drugs on the bowl and asked Cheng Dale if it was okay if they could be drinking buddies, chat, and spank each other. She encouraged him to cheer as their bowls collided. Cheng Dale chanted that geometry was life, while Fan Lihua yelled that cup to cup calls for a song. She informed him that her late father always hoped that she would find a son-in-law to help her develop the descending Jade Village, and while he could claim that the village was her dowry, she implied that he was still leaving her alone now that he occupied it. Cheng Dale told her that she always led the descending Jade Village, while Fan Lihua cursed him and said that he stole her heart and wanted to run away. She did, however, tell him that they would stop talking about it and just drink, and as Cheng Dale passed out on the table, Fan Lihua invited him to drink more. Fan Lihua smirked, wondering how he could be down after only a few drinks, while Cheng Dale, drunk, grumbled about how hot it was. Fan Lihua inquired if he ever liked her, wondering if the drug was having an effect, and Cheng Dale replied, of course. She pounced over him and chuckled, saying she knew it. She kissed Cheng Dale countless times and took off his clothes. Then a person came in, addressing Cheng Dale and telling him that they made him Tong Sui. Both Fan Lihua and Cheng Dale were shocked while making a mess around them. Su Ying was irritated, and a system notification stated that her liking for Fan Lihua shifted from good sisters who needed to be examined to hateful cheating cats. Cheng Dale was perplexed and called out Su Ying, while Fan Lihua's jaw widened. Su Ying took a deep breath. She informed Fan Lihua that Cheng Dale was drunk and asked for her forgiveness if she had offended her with her words and actions. Su Ying dragged Cheng Dale outside, while informing Fan Lihua that it was already late, and she should get some rest. Fan Lihua said nothing as she was left alone. She cursed under her breath. As Su Ying helped the drunk Cheng Dale, Fan Lihua realized that his beard was cut off. Someone grumbled, stating that it was so hot. Cheng Dale asked Su Ying if she could open the window as it was so hot. Su Ying assumed things because Cheng Dale was not that drunk, despite not being a heavy drinker. She presumed he was a guy who wanted to cheat. Su Ying thought that Cheng Dale had luck with ladies. After a while, as the morning birds woke up, someone groaned. Cheng Dale wondered as he woke up with a sore back and weak knees, but the memory of last night was blanked. While Su Ying slept beside him, the madam praised him after hearing that the herbs, salt, and tea leaves were delivered. She stated that it was the first trading, and that they needed to open up the market first, which was why they would only bring 20 packs of goods. Su Ying informed them that, in addition to the goods, there was camping equipment, and that this time they would be escorted by the Taman squad, who would bring 50 men with them. Cheng Dale informed Su Ying that the mountain trading route was dangerous, telling her that she did not have to follow him, and Liu Jihan told him that she also wanted to go. Su Ying argued that they didn't know how to do business because they were too busy fighting every day. She explained that's why she went to accompany them on their first trip, so they wouldn't be deceived by others until bankruptcy. Liu Jihan insisted, telling Su Ying that she also wanted to follow. Kin Man reported to Cheng Dale that all the stuff was ready, and that they could set off at any time and Cheng Dale thanked him for his trouble, while Liu Jihan sneaked away behind them. Enraged, Su Ying scolded Liu Jihan to go back because she was not allowed to come with them, making Liu Jihan screech. Depressed, Liu Jihan expressed her desire to follow Cheng Dale, but Su Ying told her not to because they were not going out to play this time, and advised her not to cause trouble. Cheng Dale said his goodbye to Liu Jihan who waved at them. Liu Jihan wished them a safe trip and told Cheng Dale to come back soon. Su Ying became aware of Liu Jihan's whining when she stated that they were only going away for a few days. She asked Cheng Dale if he was reluctant, and Cheng Dale responded a little, but Su Ying simply stated that it was time to go, as they had a lot of love debts, and that their first stop was the descending Jade Village. After a while, someone said that by climbing over the descending Jade Village's mountain range, they could go around the shortcut to reach the trading route, 
and that the village also had a type of short-legged horse that was thought to be more suitable for traveling mountain roads. The voice added that they would change to those types of horses and find a guide to guide them, to prevent them from getting lost. While Xiao Linger realized how short the horse was, Su Ying asked Cheng Dale why he brought the three military officers, and he replied that it was to interact with them and to build trust. Su Ying asked him if they could trust them. Cheng Dale informed her that he specially investigated before, that those three and Mo Mingmi's relation were the most hostile, and Yun Zhonglong had a grudge with Mo Mingmi. That was why he immediately submitted when he was captured, while the other two had not much interaction with Mo Mingmi after getting liberated by him. He said that they were all mountain bandits looking for money, and since he brought them to earn money, he believed that sooner or later they would be one of his men. Su Ying inquired if he was not going to meet Fan Lihua because she noticed she liked him so much. The two of them indulged themselves as they chatted where Cheng Dale expressed that it wasn't like he didn't want to meet her, it was just he couldn't beat her. He claimed that Fan Lihua had a short temper and was foolish, and if she flipped out, she was going to catch him and beat him up, as he still wanted to keep his reputation. Not knowing how long he lay down, Cheng Dale started to feel sleepy while he wondered why they were so slow. Cheng Dale claimed that the world was very quiet, with no phone, internet, just tedious and boring that one could spend a whole afternoon staring at a cloud and daydreaming. He went on to say that one could also spend a few months just waiting for a person's letter. After some time, Kin Man and the others began marching. He called out to Cheng Dale and informed him that all things were ready and that they could set off anytime. Cheng Dale praised them and asked if they had found a guide to guide them. Kin Man informed him that it was a good guide, before asking Cheng Dale if he wanted to guess who it was. Cheng Dale wondered who else it could be until someone in a white robe mentioned themselves. Fan Li Hua greeted Cheng Dale asking if he was surprised or shocked. Kin Man informed Cheng Dale that Fan Li Hua grew up around the area, and was familiar with the surroundings. He asked him if he was surprised, and Cheng Dale stated that he sure was surprised and sarcastically told him he did a good job. Fan Li Hua noticed Su Ying and wondered why she was following him again. While Su Ying wondered why in the world they called Fan Li Hua because she knew it would be difficult to spend time with Cheng Dale, making Cheng Dale tremble for the gathering of both women. Cheng Dale wondered if they would start fighting and tear him in half. Someone instructed them that they're going. After they left the descending Jade Village, the group continued heading into the mountain range. Kin Man inquired the lieutenants if they had noticed. He went on to say that Cheng Dale had been unusually quiet, despite the fact that they expected him to be very talkative, and that he had also noticed that Fan Li Hua appeared happy and talked cheerfully, and Cheng Dale let out an awkward laugh. The group continued to march towards the mountain. Someone cautioned them to be careful of the cliff. The grassy area was cut off by Kin Man and the others. He continued to pave a way through the bushes. Kin Man felt relieved after he finally came out. Then there was a hanging bridge beyond a cliff in front of him, as well as a massive mountain. Ammon steps forward and states that the trading route has an unexpectedly dangerous bridge. Cheng Dale is certain why no one is using the route, as it immediately becomes hell mode due to the suspense bridge. He claims that the bridge will not be able to withstand future trade and that if they want to support unending goods traffic, they will need to rebuild a new bridge, while claiming that their priority right now is to pass through the bridge because they don't have any tools to repair it and they will have to wait until next time. He instructs Kin Man, if he could trouble him, to check on the bridge's condition, and Kin Man agrees. After some time, a report comes in stating that the suspense bridge has some traces of erosion, but the structure is stable, and it should be able to support the caravan, and Cheng Dale asks Kin Man why they didn't get around the canyon, and Kin Man replies that the route was a shortcut, and if they took a detour, it would take them a few more days to travel, and someone suggests that they split them into batches and move slowly, as they might be able to pass through it. The horses neigh in shock, as their hooves clack into the ground. Yun Zhonglong asks Cheng Dale what they should do as the horses refuse to cross the bridge. Fan Li Hua tells Cheng Dale that she got a plan stating that they should unload the goods first and carry them on back to pass through. Use black cloths to cover the horse's eye and have someone lead them, and Cheng Dale agrees and tells everyone to follow her plan and unload the goods. He instructs them that people go first, and five people in a group, to carry the goods and walk slowly and informs them that the horses go last and have to travel with them in pairs. Someone yells at them to stand straight, not to look down, and to keep looking at the front person's head so they wouldn't feel scared. It also warns them to be cautious and to hold on to the chain five men per group, and it takes them half a day to cross it, and most of them have crossed the suspense bridge, and as a man holds tight on the bridge's chain. However, at some parts where they were unable to inspect, 
The bridge's chain cracks. Cheng Dalei tells Su Ying to be careful as they cross the bridge. The chains snap, and the bridge becomes unstable, making everyone scream as they realize that it is not good. Cheng Dalei tells them not to panic and instructs the people in front not to worry about the goods anymore and throw them away, as they should cross the bridge fast. He instructs the people behind to fall back and stop moving forward. As the people hold on tightly, Cheng Dale yells at them to hold on the chains and go up quickly, hurrying them to move towards the cliff. He yelled at them to walk fast. The bridge snapped, making a loud noise, and someone told them to be careful as another one broke. The three lieutenants screamed as one of them fell. Cheng Dale called out to Kaio He and Jiyalu, realizing that they were falling. Both men screamed. Cheng Dale's eyes narrowed. He held out his arms. Cheng Dale grabbed both lieutenants' arms. He told them to hold on tight as he's going to pull them both up. Ji Lu showed his gratitude towards Cheng Dale, and Cheng Dale told him to come up. Someone screamed that the bridge was broken as it snapped at the other end of it. Cheng Dale and the others held on tight as they swung with the bridge. Fan Lihua and Su Ying fell off, which made Cheng Dale call out to her. Cheng Dale's face darkened. Su Ying called out for Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale held out his hand, screaming Su Ying's name. However, Fan Lihua also descended as both of them tried to save Su Ying. Fan Lihua was closely approaching Su Ying. She grabbed her in her arms. As she took a rope on her waist, she told Cheng Dale to catch the rope she threw. Cheng Dale grabbed the rope while he unsheathed his sword. He stabbed it at the cliff as he released his colorless double wing phoenix skill. The sword still slid through the rock. He held on tightly to the rope. A creaky noise was heard as they continued to descend at a fast pace. They came to a halt while hanging beneath the cliff. Cheng Dale's men shouted out to him, concerned, inquiring about his well-being. Assuring them he was fine, Cheng Dale urgently requested to throw a rope. Cheng Dale instructed his companions to pull up Li Hua and Su Ying first before his rescue. Having narrowly avoided a dangerous fall, Su Ying embraced Cheng Dale, her relief palpable as she voiced her fears of never seeing him again. Cheng Dale comforted her, calming her worries that he was fine. Meanwhile, Li Hua silently watched Cheng Dale and Su Ying, and a touch of envy flickered in her eyes. After Su Ying's tears were shed, she turned her gratitude towards Li Hua, acknowledging her for saving her life. Su Ying pledged never to forget Li Hua's great kindness. Feeling a bit awkward, Li Hua reassured Su Ying, emphasizing that they were family. She pointed out that if anything happened to her, Cheng Dale would be sad. Cheng Dale couldn't help but notice the strange competitive tone between Li Hua and Su Ying, though it seemed somewhat less than before. Abruptly, Zhang Long called out to Cheng Dale, acknowledging their luck in escaping with no casualties, but lamenting the loss of some goods. Cheng Dale responded emphatically, prioritizing the safety of their people. However, their problem was that Kin Man was stranded on the opposite side of the canyon, while Kin Man and the rest of the men were silent about the situation. Inquiring about the possibility of retracing their steps, Cheng Dale was met with Zhang Long's explanation that the canyon spanned numerous mountains, rendering it a substantial and impractical detour. The group was stranded in the deep mountain with no guide to lead their way. Cheng Dale proposed the solution to construct a bridge across the narrowest part of the canyon, recognizing that they could build a bridge, and acknowledging that building a bridge was their only option. Li Hua questioned Cheng Dale's certainty highlighting the canyon's 10-foot width and the seemingly impossible task of building a bridge overnight. Collected, Cheng Dale calmly questioned why it would be deemed impossible. He invoked the saying that if one wants to become rich, one needs to build a road, emphasizing that it was time to show the speed of the so-called infrastructure maniac from Toad Village. Taking charge, Cheng Dale dispatched people back, and after five days, a majestic engineering team comprising up to 300 people arrived. This elite group included several first-class craftsmen alongside countless others. A local villager urgently instructed the others to hasten and bring up iron chains, while another person sought out Cheng Dale, informing him that they brought food for everyone. With purpose, the assembled team began to command to tear the broken bridge and salvage usable materials. One person mentioned that Kin Man was on the opposite side, emphasizing the need for both sides to cooperate in building a rope bridge that could accommodate people. A person informed them that there were numerous hundred-year-old white fruit trees, each towering over ten feet tall. Eagerly, they felled the trees and divided them in half. Collaboratively, one person directed others to pick up the pulley while the massive wooden sections were pulled. 
With synchronized effort, commands echoed from both sides, instructing them to put the wood up. Amid the construction, Cheng Dale urged heightened attention to safety, emphasizing the use of safety ropes to prevent any unfortunate falls. The sounds of workers resonated in the surroundings. One individual directed the chain to be sent, while others focused on stabilizing the base and hitting the rivets. Reports arrived confirming that the blacksmith shop produced a lot of chains, ensuring there were enough for them. Upon completing the bridge, a report came, affirming that the work was done. However, concerns were raised as they acknowledged that the purely wooden bridge had a limited lifespan. To ensure continued trading, they recognized to strengthen the structure continuously with chains. It took seven days to complete the bridge repair project. A beep notified about triggering the village skill construction proficiency. This skill reduced the construction consumption time by 50%. With the bridge ready, Cheng Dale ordered the transportation of goods and horses across it, and his men confirmed. Observing the accomplishment, Li Hua, Yu Ju Lu, and the others marveled at the sight. Wearing a satisfied grin, Cheng Dale proudly declared that his people could build a big village in two months, and the bridge was just like a stream of abundant water. In time, Kin Man called Cheng Dale. Turning to face Kin Man, Cheng Dale mused on the rumor that Kin Man had played a desperate helping hand during the bridge construction. Kin Man suddenly kneeled and admitted his fault. He requested punishment, leaving Cheng Dale surprised and asked what he was doing. Blaming himself, Kin Man openly acknowledged that his negligence and carelessness could have resulted in death, insisting that he deserved punishment. Compassionate, Cheng Dale approached Kin Man and urged him to stand and talk. However, Kin Man remained resolute, asserting that he wouldn't dare to rise unless he faced punishment. Amidst that, Su Ying calls Cheng Dale. She relays a disconcerting discovery that their people had found evidence that the previous bridge chain was artificially cut off. Displaying the compromised chain, Su Ying detailed how someone had used a saw to cut a crucial part before burying it in the soil. She continued that the bridge was barely supporting its weight initially and risked collapse if subjected to continuous use. Infuriated, Kin Man expressed his frustration, affirming that the act was aimed at them. Expressing suspicion, Cheng Dale remarked on the hundred secrets and one sparse, highlighting their carelessness. He mentioned Mo Mingmi, stating that he truly knows how to play the game. With a furrowed brow, Cheng Dale contemplated the fact that Mo Mingmi had nearly killed many of his men. The intense hatred causes him to vow to take note of it. He called Kin Man who responded quickly, and swiftly issued orders to assemble ten men to establish a station post at a critical junction on the commercial road and ten groups of people would operate on a seven-day rotational shift, ensuring to prevent the recurrence of such incidents. With the security measures in place, Cheng Dale resolved to resume the road construction, emphasizing his determination to settle the score with Mo Mingmi sooner or later. Kin Man affirmed his orders. The team continued to depart through the canyon, being careful along the way, and not daring to be careless. Encountering wild tigers in the wild occasionally could be dangerous. Soon after, they became an extra meal for them. While eating, Li Hua remarked that eating rations every day made birds fade out of her mouth. Kin Man humorously added salt in a salt bee style, and Su Ying suggested to Cheng Dale to eat more tiger meat to invigorate Yang. Cheng Dale, however, remained silent. Moments later, they encountered a wild blind bear, which meant a larger meal. While cooking, Li Hua expressed amusement at the food, Kin Man's playful addition like a salt bee, and Su Ying commented about invigorating Yang. As they continued their journey, they encountered a group of monkeys throwing feces at them. Li Hua became furious and chased them away with a bow and arrow. Five days later, the team finally came out of the Kinchuan Mountains, entered the grassland, and found an empty spot in the field. As night fell, one of them highlighted that the grassland had dozens of tribes, big and small. The smallest was estimated to have a few dozen people, and the largest may have tens of thousands, such as the Western Ring Tribe and Western Yan Tribe. The master behind these tribes was supposedly Jin Wendao. Li Hua commented that she heard Jin Wendao and Mo Mingmi were trading a lot of iron ore and forming a heavy cavalry. She remarked that in a few months, Jin Wendao might have taken the throne. Cheng Dale mentioned that the name Jin Wendao sounded familiar. Li Hua asked Cheng Dale if he knew Jin Wendao. Tao he sighed, stating that the Ring tribe's fight for the throne was getting more intense. Zhang Long added that many tribes had been involved. Cheng Dale responded that he fought with Jin Wendao two years ago, and wondered why he was alive. While busy looking at the map, Cheng Dale emphasized that since the Ring tribe was at war, he asked if they could still do business. They confirmed that there are rules for fighting over territory, and some places would not be affected by the war. Zhang Long mentioned that there is a fixed trading market in the grassland. 
The tribes regularly traded their supplies there every month, and everyone had something to buy. He continued stating that if the market is turned upside down, it would be hostile to everyone. Su Ying chimed in, saying that the Ring tribe is more used to bartering and is still at the very beginning of commerce. She gave examples like salt, tea, and herbs that could be used as currency. She continued that after all, the following day was the trade fair. Cheng Dalei acknowledged it and concluded that tomorrow, he, Li Hua, and Su Ying would take a batch of goods first to explore the situation and the rest would stay to guard the goods. Li Yua, shifting the conversation, inquired about Cheng Dalei's axe. Cheng Dalei explained it had been used in the bridge construction last time, so he arranged for someone to bring it along. Li Hua recommended that Cheng Dalei bring the axe with him the next day, suggesting it could be handy in case he encountered someone who might try to rob him. Cheng Dalei, puzzled by the suggestion, sought clarification and asked why. She explained that in the martial world, others might not have known what he looked like, but his weapon and technique would certainly spread farther than his appearance. Li Hua emphasized that Cheng Dalei used the ordinary sword to kill Longting, snatch Wanner, assassinate Hu Yanba, and accomplish other great things. The ordinary sword already represented his identity. Calmly, Cheng Dalei responded that it was all the fame that came from killing in the pile of corpses. Li Hua emphasized that although the Ring tribe worshipped the strong, if their fists were big enough and their strength strong enough, there would be no shortage of people worshipping him as a king in that place. However, she emphasized that Cheng Dalei was an exception. He was so famous that many princes wanted his head at a high price. Once his identity was exposed, the aftermath would be troublesome. Cheng Dalei acknowledged her words, expressed his understanding, and assured her that he would enter the village quietly without making any sounds. It was late at night, and the dew gradually fell with everyone dispersing one by one until only Cheng Dalei remained outside. Inside the tent, Kaio he inquired of Zhonglong whether Cheng Dalei could make them rich. He added that even if the business road was open, they would still be viewed suspiciously by Mo Mingmen. Yu Ju Lu pointed out that they were following Cheng Dalei, and once Mo Mingmi regained strength, he would make use of them. Zhonglong responded that he didn't think it was a big deal. He continued, highlighting that when he first arrived, Cheng Dalei only had 2,000 people, and their 18 lieutenant allied forces couldn't do anything to him. Now, he not only stood firm but could also make Mo Mingmi bow his head. He emphasized that they sold themselves to Mo Mingmi for so long, and now that they wanted to kill them along with Cheng Dalei, while Kaio he listened silently. Zhonglong added that, on the contrary, Cheng Dalei saved the three of them. As long as they worked hard and remained loyal to Cheng Dalei, he would take care of Mo Mingmi, and he would do something for them, and Kaio he agreed. Shifting the conversation, Yu Ju Lu asked if they had heard that someone in the south had raised the counter flag, signifying that chaos was coming. In response, Zhonglong assured them to follow Cheng Dalei, and their futures would be secure. After their conversation, Zhonglong exited the tent. He approached Cheng Dalei, who was sitting near the bonfire, and mentioned that he had told them everything smirked, Cheng Dalei acknowledged it. Zhonglong commented that he believed they would ride on their pirate ship. Cheng Dalei asked what he meant by a pirate ship and warned him to watch his mouth. Zhonglong repeatedly confirmed it. As morning arrived, Cheng Dalei contemplated that, in addition to commerce, his biggest goal of the trip was to complete this mission. He looked at his tasks and thought about the silver eyes and the bracelet. The Myojong traces on her body made him wonder if her physique would be different from normal people. He highlighted that such an obvious feature should attract people's attention. And if one wanted to find someone in the vast grassland, the market was the place with the most information. While contemplating, Su Ying called him and informed him that everything was set and they could go, which he acknowledged. Li Hua reminded him not to forget to bring the axe. As they ventured into Ring tribe territory, she emphasized that they should be wary. Nevertheless, Cheng Dalei conveyed to Kin Man the request to set up a camp in the designated area and wait prompting Kin Man to confirm. Somewhere in the grassland, Li Yua pointed out the presence of a relatively rare forest, located amid many tribes. It appeared to be the market trade fair. She explained that frequent wars occurred among the small tribes of the Ring clan. Each family had a hatred for killing their fathers, taking their wives, and sort of things. She noted that if one proved stronger than the others, even stealing wives would result in them willingly becoming slaves. Li Hua jokingly emphasized that they couldn't engage in actions like stealing someone's wife while glancing at Cheng Dalei. Smiling awkwardly, Cheng Dalei recalled the past incident when he stole Su Ying, but he simply nodded to Li Hua, stating that they were civilized people. As they headed to the forest, Cheng Dalei called Su Ying and Li Hua to ask for help inquiring about a 14-year-old girl with silver eyes and a silver bracelet. 
curious, Su Ying asked who that was and how she never heard of him knowing someone like that. Cheng Dalei responded that he was entrusted by someone, and that girl was the orphan of a deceased friend. Inside the forest, Li Hua was amused as there were a lot of people there on the first day of the market trade fair. Cheng Dalei instructed them to look around and find a place to set up a stall. As they walked through, Cheng Dalei observed the items people were selling, such as animal fur, jade, prey, war horses, and even girls. He contemplated that there were a lot of weird things being sold. Suddenly, he stopped as he caught sight of something. Surprised, he wondered if the item was a European-style telescope. Soon after, he purchased the telescope with a bag of salt. He contemplated the telescope, first invented by an optician in 1608. It had been more than a decade since it became popular and even spread to China. He also considered the geographical context, the 13 states of the empire bordered by the ocean in the east and the Ring tribe in the northwest, prompting him to question what lay further west. While contemplating history, Cheng Dalei tested the telescope, reflecting on the fact that the world's history differed from his previous life and the structure of the entire world remained a mystery. He pondered that the world was more than just the empire, and that there was more beyond the empire, and the ring tribe outside the empire. Feeling dismayed, he wondered what lay beyond the rings. Continuing, he caught sight of Su Ying and Li Hua, who noticed his fascination with the object. Su Ying asked him what it was, and Li Hua, recognizing the item, inquired if it was the Thousand Mile Mirror from the Far West. Both Su Ying and Li Hua smiled at him. Su Ying questioned Cheng Dalei if he could see clearly. Cheng Dalei responded with a smile, stating that he could see clearly and thought that they seemed to be getting close those days. Su Ying advised Cheng Dalei to stop playing and hastened him to put out their goods on display. Soon after, their goods were arranged. A person selling nearby noticed them and drew the attention of others to Cheng Dalei's salt, tea leaves, and herbs. Another person mentioned that their items were in demand. Annoyed, a man asked who Cheng Dalei was. Others speculated that he might be an imperial. One man reacted, stating that it had been a long time since he had seen an imperial in the market. Another man pointed out that there were only four of them and asked the other man if he wanted to fight. Cheng Dalei held onto his axe, emphasizing that once goods were out, some people became greedy, making it easy to be robbed without the strength to trade. He swung his axe in front of them and introduced himself as Ali Appa, claiming to have come on the trip just for business with them. The man mentioned that the axe was heavy, but Cheng Dalei easily carried it on his back. Another man commented that he could use such a heavy axe as a weapon and pointed out that the woman next to him might not be a good person either. They reassured others to be careful, as they didn't know where those three came from. Then Cheng Dalei added that if they all didn't want him to do business, they could ask the axe in his hand if it agreed. Amidst the arguments, a man politely engaged in conversation with Cheng Dalei, addressing him as a friend. He asked if he could trade a horse for three bags of salt. Cheng Dalei responded that it was no problem. Other people followed, inquiring if they could trade their hound for bags of salt as well. One person presented gems, asking if he could trade them for five bags of tea leaves. Another person joined, offering a 16-year-old girl as a potential slave, describing her as delicate. With a nice figure and beautiful looks, he asked making a trade. Another man responded with laughter, suggesting the man bring his wife instead, stating that female slaves are not very convenient. Amidst the banter, Cheng Dalei asked everyone about a girl with silver eyes, stating that if the information was real, he was willing to trade 10 bags of salt for it. Finally, Cheng Dalei used the three packets of goods on hand for many gems, jade, 10 horses, and some grassland, especially herbs, but obtained no useful information about a silver-eyed girl. Upon returning to their tent, Li Hua expressed her surprise as she did not expect to get so many things in exchange for the three packs of goods. Su Ying responded, stating that the ring tribes were indeed straightforward. If they liked something, they were generous and never bargained. Cheng Dalei emphasized that cotton and ironware were also in demand, and they could bring more next time. Continuing, he reiterated the plan for the next day, emphasizing that they would all go together and bring all the goods. Showing enthusiasm, Kin Man predicted they were going to make a lot of money this time. Not far away, hidden from view, two individuals observed the group. One of them exclaimed that they discovered the hiding place of Cheng Dale and noted the abundance of stuff they brought along. The other person suggested his pal stay there and keep an eye on them as he was planning to report back to their chief. The person responded, urging his pal to hurry up, as they were not the only ones watching them. As the night fell, at the Toad Village temporary camp, in the quiet of the night, Cheng Dalei was sleeping, and someone quietly sneaked into his room. He noticed the presence and swiftly sat up. 
To his realization, it was Lihua. Curious, he inquired why she hadn't slept yet. Lihua, with a soft demeanor, explained that she could not sleep, leaving her to come and see him. She shared that she had been sleeping with Su Ying for the past few days and had been talking to her about some things. Her tone shifted slightly as she continued, revealing that Su Ying had confided in her about his preference for gentle and ladylike girls. Blushing, Li Hua presented a pouch she had crafted, expressing that she had made it especially for him. However, Cheng Dale's unresponsive expression remained unchanged and only called her name. If a person puts aside their sword to make needlework, even if it stabs his hand, the finished product still looks very bad. The stitching is disorganized, and the threads are messy. Feeling a tinge of embarrassment, Lihua eagerly asked if he liked it. But he couldn't throw it away after all. This is a girl's heart stitch. Originally, he thought Lihua only had special feelings for him after suffering together. But now he feels her heart's heavy affection. If such a beautiful woman falls in love and devotes herself, heaven doesn't grant it. He's afraid it will damage her predestined lifespan. Indifferently, Cheng Dale responded that he liked it and added a rhetorical question, stating, how could he not like it? Curious, Cheng Dale inquired about the design of the pouch, specifically questioning the representation of two turtles. Offended, Li Hua corrected him, explaining that those were Mandarin ducks. Suddenly, Kin Man entered the tent abruptly, bearing bad news for Cheng Dale. He relayed that the night watchman had spotted a group of cavalry approaching. Irritated, Lihua pondered the timing and questioned why they had chosen this particular moment. Remaining calm, Cheng Dale acknowledged the report, recognizing the unfavorable situation. He instructed everyone to wake up and prepare to face the approaching enemy. They mounted their horses as soon as they awoke. The enemy questioned them about Cheng Dale's group camping without permission, aiming to induce terror by implying they were unaware of the laws. The opposing side's leader, Lu Hong, instructed Cheng Dale to leave all their belongings behind and pretend that nothing happened. However, maintaining his composure, Cheng Dale responded that it was the first time that was natural for them to be suppressed by local thugs, and they either paid or fought, while Li Yue beside him was visibly pissed. He suggested they either paid or fought to conduct business safely. Cheng Dale dismissed Lu Hong's reasoning as dull, but Li Hua interjected, telling Cheng Dale that he was talking nonsense and that she should cut them. Outraged, Li Hua charged forward, accusing them of daring to spoil their grandma's good deed and challenging them to eat her sword. Cheng Dale sought Kin Man, who promptly commanded his subordinates. Tai He, visibly scared, turned to Zhang Glong for guidance on what they should do next. In fear, Zhang Glong asked what else they could do, emphasizing that they were all in the same boat. Cheng Dale's group launched an attack with the command to break the army, behead the generals, and kill the enemy. All his men echoed the call to kill them. His men accompanying them were elite troops from Toad Village, and they advanced toward the enemy. On the opposing side, there was surprise and disbelief that Cheng Dale would dare to charge at them. Some expressed the sentiment that the attackers should recognize the strength of the Ring tribe. Feeling indignant, Lu Hong ordered his forces to engage and kill them. In the ensuing clash, the two forces collided in the middle of the night. In the forest, a man asked if they heard about Cheng Dale being targeted by Lu Hong of the Western Ring Tribe the previous day. One person confirmed that they heard and expressed pity, noting that it was challenging to buy goods from Cheng Dale as they would be forcibly seized by the Western Ring Tribe. The conversation continued with the person stating that it was like killing the goose that laid the golden egg and believed Cheng Dale's goods were not bad. The other man mentioned that the two chicks were pretty good, and if not caught by Lu Hong, the two women might still be here. The man responded by laughing, stating that they bought them as they were rare beauties. Their conversation stopped as they saw a group approaching from a distance. To their surprise, they questioned if it was them, with another man expressing disbelief and asking if the information was fake. Cheng Dale announced that they brought more goods this time, including salt, tea leaves, and herbs. He called Kin Man to bring all the goods, and Kin Man confirmed. And he announced to everyone that they got a new shipment last night, consisting of slaves who delivered themselves to their door, caught fresh and energetic. The gossipers were surprised. Cheng Dale declared to start the bidding. The onlookers called for Lu Hong, with one person expressing disbelief that they got caught by Cheng Dale. A person suddenly called out to Cheng Dale's attention and complimented his skills. The person approached them and asked if he could release Lu Hong and he was willing to pay a ransom. Cheng Dale pointed out if he meant Lu Hong, and the person confirmed that Lu Hong was his good-for-nothing subordinate. The person introduced himself as the eldest son of the chief of the Western Ring tribe, Hai Yan. Cheng Dale also introduced himself as Ali Appa. He mentioned that they were there for business and warned Hai Yan that if they made a move, everyone would be happy to make money. 
He warned them again that if they dared to make a move on them, they should be prepared to turn themselves into goods, as goods are naturally meant to be sold. However, Hai Yan responded that Lu Hong made a move on them but missed and got caught. He mentioned the rules of the grassland and that he, himself was willing to use 50 animal skins and 20 horses as ransom. In addition, he hoped that Cheng Dalei could sell them all the herbs at a negotiable price. Contemplating the events of the previous night's battle, Cheng Dalei assessed that there was no hostility from the Western Ring tribe but rather a newfound respect. In light of this, he decided that a peaceful negotiation would be the best course of action. Without making a smiling face, he agreed to Hai Yan's proposal, instructing him to return with the agreed-upon ransom, assuring Hai Yan that they would patiently await his return. However, Cheng Dalei had one more thing to say. He called Hai Yan and informed him that he came to the grassland to do business and look for a 14-year-old girl with silver pupils. Hai Yan, intrigued by the unique eyes, mentioned that it was easy to remember. He agreed to go back and inquire among his men to ask around. Doubting, Kin Man questioned the nature of the people, expressing concern about the possibility of them going back on their words. Li Hua reassured him, stating that the Ring tribe was known to be quite trustworthy. Cheng Dalei encouraged them to continue selling. After a while, Hai Yan and his group returned. He mentioned that, in addition to the animal skins and horses used for the ransom, Hai Yan brought other goods and proposed trading herbs directly with Cheng Dalei. Since Cheng Dalei was a businessman, Hai Yan requested the preparation of more medicinal herbs, expressing the desire to establish direct trading with their Western Ring tribe. Considering the potential of having regular customers so soon, especially from a significant tribe like the Western Yan tribe, Cheng Dalei thought it wasn't a bad deal. He assured Hai Yan that it was their pleasure to do business with him and asked if he had any information about the little girl. Fortuitously, Hai Yan conveyed that they found some information. A small tribe situated in the western part of the grassland seemed to be the home of a strange girl with silver eyes. According to his men, she exhibited divine powers, so she was the person Cheng Dalei was looking for. Hai Yan further assisted their quest by providing a road map, which he thought Cheng Dalei needed. Cheng Dalei expressed gratitude to Hai Yan, acknowledging his thoughtfulness. After receiving the guide, Cheng Dalei contemplated that he hadn't mentioned the girl's special physique. However, the information Hai Yan brought stated that the little girl was born with divine power, making the credibility of this information high. Nonetheless, Cheng Dalei decided to be cautious, considering the possibility of a trap. He called Kin Man to instruct him to carry back the exchanged goods, prompting Kin Man to confirm. He also called Li Hua and Su Ying to accompany him, and Li Hua affirmed it. Cheng Dalei thought that he should take them due to Li Hua's horsemanship and Su Ying's insight, which would be useful. The three followed the guide to look for. Occasionally, they used salt blocks to inquire from nearby tribes. As they asked for directions, the man pointed out that it should be in that direction. He warned them to be careful because the armies of Jin Wendao and the 18th prince were confronting each other in the northwest of the grassland. The ongoing battle might soon reach the western part of the grassland. They continued walking for two straight days and finally reached that mountain range. Quietly, Cheng Dalei was surprised, while Su Ying remarked that the disputes in the grassland never stopped, and it turns out that there is such a peaceful valley hidden from the world. Li Hua commented on the beauty of the view. As they looked in the serenity of the place, Cheng Dalei instructed them to come along as they went to inquire. Approaching the village, Cheng Dalei introduced their group as businessmen, stating that they were looking. But before he could finish his words, an old man interrupted him, concluding his words stating silver eyes. He sought information from the old man if Cheng Dalei was referring to a Mu's little girl. The old man recognized that they were referring to Niu Niu. Cheng Dalei inquired about the name Niu Niu, and the old man responded that the girl was very strong, so they nicknamed her Niu Niu. Amidst their conversation, the old man noted that there she was, while Niu Niu was whizzing, and Cheng Dalei and Li Hua glanced at her. Carrying a container of straw food behind, Niu Niu continued whizzing. Cheng Dalei thinks about Niu Niu's silver pupils, born with divine powers, and is delighted that they found the right person. Approaching Niu Niu, Cheng Dalei and Li Hua tried to engage in conversation with her. Cheng Dalei showed her the bracelet to see if she would recognize it, while Li Hua asked about her name. However, Niu Niu became scared, perceiving them as malicious figures. From her perspective, it seems that they were trying to persuade her by showing her a treasure. Niu Niu headbutted Cheng Dalei, causing a loud thud, and shouted in pain, while Li Hua was surprised by it. As Niu Niu ran away, Cheng Dalei acknowledged Niu Niu's incredible strength. Su Ying asked if he was okay, and Li Hua was surprised to see him with a nosebleed. 
Cheng Dale called her silver-eyed girl, asking her not to leave as they were not bad guys. Ni Yu hugged an elderly woman, asking Cheng Dale, Su Ying, and Li Hua if they were from the Empire. The elderly woman expressed her uncertainty about the guests from the Empire coming all the way there, and inquired about their purpose, while Ni Yu hid behind her. Cheng Dale mentioned that his name was Aliapa and that he was entrusted to him by his late friend. The elderly woman invited them inside to have a glass of water and rest for a bit. Wu Lumu called Ni Yu to come closer, and Ni Yu complied without saying a word. Surprisingly, the elderly woman noted that the bracelet was the same. She expressed her disbelief, mentioning that she didn't expect people in this world to still be looking for her and considered it a blessing for Ni Yu, showing that many people care about her. The elderly woman shared her story, revealing that her name was Wu Lumu. She originally lived in the central part of the grassland, but her two sons were captured by the Ring tribe and died in battle shortly afterward. She moved to the west part of the grassland, discovered the valley, and settled down, smiling. She mentioned that it was a long time since she adopted Ni Yu Nu. As Wu Lumu's stories continued, she still remembers the night they all came together to celebrate the Sacred Fire Festival. Suddenly, a table in the back corner was knocked over, startling everyone. The clan saw only the silver eyes in the darkness, rustling and eating. It was originally thought that a hungry wolf entered the clan, but when everyone came closer to see, it turned out to be a small child, dark and small, with eyes shining silver, somewhat sinister. She looked like a hungry young wolf. The person speculated that Niyunyu was a slave and questioned how she managed to escape. The person ordered another person to send Wu Lumu to come. Besides her, the man commented that Niyunyu might be sinning, highlighting that she was just a small child. Meanwhile, the woman inquired about how Niyunyu ended up wandering across the grassland. Wu Lumu shared that it was her first encounter with Niyunyu, describing her as a gift from God to her. She was named Niyunyu Yinmu from that moment on, highlighting that she was a good and special child. Despite being long and thin, Yin Mu was incredibly strong, earning her the nickname Cowgirl. During their conversation, someone commented that Ni Yu was supposed to be grazing the cow, questioning why she carried it on her back. Both Ni Yu and the cow seemed puzzled by the events. She revealed that Ni Yu was mute, perhaps it was the act of a human trafficker. Wu Lumu chuckled as she shared the story, explaining that every time Ni Yu returned from grazing, she didn't know how to get someone's attention. To solve this, Wu Lumu made her a whistle and an ocarina, and taught Ni Yu how to play a melody, and Ni Yu proved to be very well behaved. Every time she came back from grazing, she would whistle, and everyone knew immediately that Ni Yu was coming back. Over the years, Wu Lumu watched Ni Yu grow into a beautiful little girl, and she couldn't express how happy and excited she felt. She mentioned that her heart ached with excitement like a void. So, she called the three guests and thanked them sincerely for coming to Ni Yu. But if they take Ni Yunyu away, she asks if they could wait until she can spend her last days with Ni Yunyu. Cheng Dale quickly responded that it was not necessary, and he believed Wu Lumu was mistaken. He explained that his friend was no longer alive, and her daughter had grown up and had her own life now. If the people from that time knew about this, they might have smiled. Cheng Dale also mentioned that perhaps later, he would take Ni Yunyu to honor her real parents. He added that the bracelets, one on Ni Yunyu's wrist and the other he possesses, were originally a pair, so they should return it to its rightful owner. And since the last wish of the deceased has come true, they won't bother them further and bid their goodbyes. Wu Lumu called Cheng Dale, telling him that there was no need to rush. She suggested that since it was already late, they should stay overnight and leave the next day. She informed them that they arranged a banquet with the clan to honor the guests who had traveled from afar. After that conversation, they moved to the banquet. Su Ying called Cheng Dale's attention, and someone invited him to join for a dance. Cheng Dale, feeling shy, mentioned that he couldn't dance. He chuckled softly, expressing that if only he were there, he would be the old king of square dancing. Cheng Dale showed a modest smile, and suddenly music played, the lyrics conveyed a far, far away place. The stars shone brightly at night, and in the vast meadow, he grew up listening to his mother's heartwarming songs. He sighed, remembering his childhood and the comforting tunes of his mother. The song continued, describing someone calling him by his childhood name, looking away gently in the wind. It painted a picture of someone standing on the boundless grassland wondering who was calling him by his childhood name and looking away gently in the wind. He still stood on this boundless grassland, telling the mother that the child was going to a faraway place. As the song ended, Hart suddenly notified that Cheng Dale's task was completed. It suggested that he hit the road home, somewhere on the grassland. In the morning, Su Ying informed Cheng Dale that once a month, they exchanged silk, iron, porcelain, herbs, tea, and rice with the Ring tribe for skins, 
horses, stone, and jade. She suggested that they give the goods to the next seller, who sells them and exchanges the proceeds for silver and grain. Finally, the profits are divided proportionally among Toad Village, Descending Jade Village, and the Village of the Three Lieutenants. Su Ying also mentioned that they secured several large deals and the business was fully disclosed to the market. Cheng Dale confirmed and asked her to mount her horse as they were ready to return, and Su Ying confirmed. As their group traveled to leave, Cheng Dale noticed a commotion ahead. He informed his people to wait, as it seemed like someone was fighting in front, cautioning them to be careful. Some of Cheng Dale's men questioned what was happening and why the Ring tribe members were at each other's throats. Someone replied that tribal conflicts were not uncommon, even during the reign of the King of the Rings, let alone in the present day. Cheng Dale commented that this seemed more like a one-sided siege than a regular battle. Su Ying drew Cheng Dale's attention to a young man leading the group, identifying him as Hai Yan from the West Yan Division. Cheng Dale decided that they would greet Hai Yan after dealing with the situation. He instructed Kin Man and Li Hua to stay put, and they confirmed. Su Ying reminded Cheng Dale not to forget to wear the fake beard as they approached them. With a gesture of respect, Cheng Dale asked Hai Yan about the reason for their presence. Hai Yan reciprocated the respectful gesture and explained that Jin Wendao had recently defeated the army of the 18th prince with 10,000 iron horsemen. Some of the deserters were causing chaos, spreading fires, and looting in the area. He remarked that they were ordered to eliminate those deserters. Hai Yan asked Cheng Dale if he just returned from the western mountain a few days ago inquiring if they saw any deserters from the 18th prince on the way. Cheng Dale responded that they didn't see a single person. Hai Yan explained that the terrain in this area of the western mountain range was complex, so it was normal that they did not find them. Cheng Dale added that the grassland was vast, and the search might take some time. Then Hai Yan mentioned that he had something important to attend to and took his leave, telling Cheng Dale to take care of himself. Expressed her concern, Su Yin speculated whether deserters were fleeing toward the western mountain. She questioned if they would find the valley where Ni Yu was. Cheng Dale's eyes widened in terror, and he agreed that only some old and weak women and children belonged to their tribe in that valley. He expressed his feeling uneasy about the situation and decided that they needed to go back and check it out. As they rushedly returned to his group, Cheng Dale shouted to Kin Man, instructing him to take the merchants back, and told Li Hua to follow him. Wearing a shocked expression, Li Hua still confirmed Cheng Dale's command. They arrived at the valley at night, and the flames illuminated the grass. Cheng Dale's eyes flared in anger at what he saw. Li Hua gritted her teeth, while Su Ying was visibly shocked. The so-called flame of war could be the spark after the war, but it could also easily destroy the most beautiful things in the world. His anger was palpable. Cheng Dale urged them to hurry and check for survivors, prioritizing saving the people first. In a tent that caught fire, Su Ying looked inside and saw only dead bodies. Cheng Dale, frustrated, instructed them to quickly move the bodies outside, whether dead or alive, while someone was sobbing. In another tent, he found Niu Niu and her Wu Lumu. Shattered, he ran to them while calling their names. He thinks that Wu Lumu sacrificed herself to shield Niu Niu, and they were both pierced by a sword from behind. Checking Niu Niu's airways, Cheng Dale realized there was still a pulse. Anxious, he urgently called Hart for help. He pleaded with Hart to save Niu Niu. Hart explained that it sensed the master's bloody breath and mentioned the Red Sky Sword moving foolishly. Confused, she corrected herself, realizing it was not the Red Sky but it was Little Bai, the White Snake. She asked the White Snake if even her remaining soul begged her to save Niu Niu. During her appeals, a ding sound from the system warned that there was no triggerable task to directly mobilize system power. But, Hart revealed that it couldn't directly use its energy to save Niu Niu. Another ding followed, notifying that by draining the remaining power of the White Serpent bloodline from the sword, the Red Sky Sword had split in two. One part retained the remaining power of the White Snake bloodline, while the other one contained the ontological power of the Red Sky. She suggested that to save Niyunu's life, she would have to give her all the remaining power of the White Snake on the Red Sky Sword, hoping she could harness the extraordinary power. The village disappeared, and Su Ying covered Niyunu with a blanket, while Cheng Dale kneeled among the dead. Su Ying informed him that Niyunu's breathing had stabilized, and she slept soundly. She also mentioned that Li Yue had tracked down the killer by following the horseshoe marks, but the hope was slim. Speaking with frustration, Su Ying revealed that this tribe, which amounted to around 50 people, currently only had Niu Niu left. While Niu Niu slept peacefully, Su Ying called Cheng Dale, but she took it back and breathed heavily. As Niu Niu slept, she dreamed of her people who called her name repeatedly. Someone was relieved that she was back. 
A person praised her for being clever and obedient, promising to teach her how to make a cricket using grass. Another voice commended her strength, while others invited her to eat. The old man inquired about whether she had returned from grazing cattle. Lastly, the voices of Wu Lumu calling her name and the people's voices shattered like glass. Niuni remembered witnessing the slaughtering happening to the people in their valley outside or inside blood splattered everywhere. The terror in her eyes was palpable and the pain in the surrounding cries overwhelmed her. She cried pitifully. Afterward, she disappeared from where she slept. Simultaneously, Su Ying softly called his name and inquired about his well-being. In response, Cheng Dale expressed frustration, stating that in this world, the death of tens or more people was commonplace. From the spring and autumn warring states period to the present, wars and massacres resulted in countless deaths over thousands of years. To him, these were just numbers, and he had taken more than a hundred lives. Witnessing an entire tribe die was disdainful to record it down in history, but a speck of dust within the chaos. Su Ying gazed at him with a sense of sorrow. Cheng Dale extended his hand, continuing to convey his thoughts. He mentioned that even though it was just a speck of dust, it still hurt when it got into the eyes. He bit his lip as he held back tears. Sharing in his sorrow, Su Ying mentioned that as long as human greed persisted, disputes were bound to be. She added that amid these conflicts, the strong would dominate, and if the weak could not resist, they were bound to be consumed. Offering solace, she mentioned that this had been the way of the world for thousands of years, and all they could do was protect their family members. Cheng Dale questioned whether it was right just because the same thing kept happening. Concern for future generations, wondering if they would have to keep fighting. He continued by mentioning that in the unending disputes, one had two options, either kill everyone, leaving only oneself or withdraw from the chaos, just hiding like a tribe in the corner, not knowing when their luck would end due to bad luck. Su Ying believed that their descendants shouldn't have to be like that, and people in this world shouldn't endure such harsh conditions. There should be a new way in this world that tells the people the way for the weak to live is to have more freedom, to be unbounded. As the horse hooves approached, Su Ying mentioned that Li Hu was back. Curious, Cheng Dale asked how it went, inquiring if she found any escapees. Li Hua informed them that she did not, as the night was dark and there were no campfires in the area, so she was unsure if they were being cautious or had already run away. Surprised, Cheng Dale suggested that they wait until morning and seek help from Hai Yan. Su Ying proposed bringing Ni Yunu. Despite her growing up in the grassland, she still looked like an empire's citizen and could not speak. Suddenly, Cheng Dale cursed as he discovered that Ni Yunu was gone. Meanwhile, somewhere at the bottom corner of the mountain rock, a person commented that it was a good hiding place, secluded and with the sound of an owl's cooing. One suggested staying there for a few days until the investigation ends, returning to the tribe. Another person mentioned the delicious booze made by the small tribe. They noticed someone, causing the person to think that there was a sound, and the other person cautioned everyone to be careful, thinking they might be pursuers. A person spotted an observing eye and wondered if it was a wild wolf, but it turned out to be Niyunu. She walked with a black strong aura, carrying a large axe, and had many wounds on her body. The tribes were surprised by Niyunu's presence, questioning what she was doing there. One asked about the axe in her hand and how she could lift such a heavy one. Tauntingly, another person commented that she was pretty. They all creepily approached Niyunu, and one greeted her, asking if she went in the wrong direction at night. Another person mentioned that since she came to their door, they had no reason not to accept her. A person added that it was a lucky night, as they now had something to eat and play with. Holding her jaw high, the man gave a creepy smile, saying to let him be happy. However, Niyunu instantly swung her axe, beheading the man. They were all surprised and ordered to go and kill Niyunu. They quickly attacked her, but Niyunu effortlessly sliced through them. Shouting in pain, one man claimed he got her and ordered others to cut her to death, insulting her as a fool. However, Niyunu growled in anger, and the cut area instantly healed. Fear was visible in his eyes, the man trembled as he spoke. Niyunu turned her glance at them, and the man exclaimed, questioning what kind of monster she was. Niyunu swung her axe at them, causing the men to scream from the swift slashes. The men continued to attack her relentlessly, with Niyunu remaining silent. She suddenly cried with uncontrollable power, causing her to growl maniacally. Niyunu surged forward, her movements swift as she cleaved through their bodies with ease. The men, gripped by terror, recounted her brutal actions, describing how she forcibly split someone in half. Others marveled at her monstrous strength, emphasizing their attempts to slash her multiple times, only to witness the wounds miraculously healing in the blink of an eye. 
Bewilderment spread among them as they questioned her nature, with some labeling her as a demon or an undead creature. Amidst the chaos of the night, the screams of the dying resonated, and the other men urged those who could to flee from the scene. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale, Su Ying, and Li Hua hurried forward. Cheng Dale inquired if they had heard a thunderous sound, and Su Ying confirmed it was up ahead. Li Hua speculated that they were hiding in that location, expressing frustration at her inability to find them earlier. As they approached, they encountered wounded men who urgently shouted to run. Two men who managed to escape tried to confront Cheng Dale, demanding to get their horses, and launched an attack. However, Cheng Dale calmly stated that they were acting recklessly, and the two men ended up dying. As they continued to go in there, Cheng Dale commented on the strong smell of blood. He instructed Li Hua and Su Ying to stay put and not enter without his signal. Cheng Dale dismounted and walked into the area, his boots splashing the blood. He discovered the dismembered bodies of the men. He thought about how Li Hua couldn't find this hidden corner even after searching for a long time. But Ni Yu had found the hideout directly. Cheng Dale softly called Ni Yu, and Ni Yu stood in the corner and suddenly dashed towards an attack. Cheng Dale was able to block her attack but was shocked by her sudden brute force. Cheng Dale informed Yin Mu that it was him, and Yin Mu hissed in response. He checked for information about her. Cheng Dale wondered what was going on and if Yin Mu could no longer distinguish him from the enemy. A system information appeared, stating Yin Mu's name, age 14, with the hidden attributes of the white snake's body. The Avenger as the system evaluated her level of combat as supreme, which made Cheng Dale curse as she became a supreme overnight. Hart informed him that Yin Mu lost control, and Cheng Dale inquired as to what was going on with Yin Mu's state. Hart informed him that to save Yin Mu, she gave her all of the White Snake's abilities, and only one of the White Snake's abilities she could mobilize, as she got the White Snake's self-healing powers, through which she could survive naturally. She also mentioned that it was the first time she directly gave extraordinary power to a mortal. She also explained that she wanted to slowly introduce Yin Mu to the power of the White Serpent after that. But her urge for revenge was stronger than she thought, which led directly to the alienation of her soul by the power of the White Snake. And she claimed that it was still too reckless to carry extraordinary power with a weak mortal will, as it would happen when the mind was immature but had great power. Hart went on to inform Cheng Dale not to fight Yin Mu because there was no point in fighting with a madman and a friendly slap in the face was useless. She told him to stay back and leave it to her because she didn't think he could take care of the situation. Hart also mentioned that the power of the system would infinitely reinforce one's desire, and stated that with such a valuable example, she could have something for her exploration of the origin of the system. Hart went on to say that by reinforcing desires like killing and hurting people to gain fear points, using fear points to become stronger, and all other signs that the system's origin was a power that brings people down, she believed that when desire reached a certain level, a person would be corrupted by the force. She reminded him that he was the system's host, and she was the administrator, and that he would not be corrupted because there was no requirement for him to use the power. She mumbled as she noticed that Yin Mu had a strong desire for revenge. She realized that after her revenge, Yin Mu did not manage to get out of the state and almost became a maniac. Hart, however, stated how fortunate she was that the corrosion did not last long, and Yin Mu was a good child by nature, and stated that as long as she was around, good children couldn't become bad ones. After a while, the crescent moon rose. Su Ying inquired about what happened, and Cheng Dale replied that he slaughtered the few remaining when he arrived. It could have been a power struggle or a fight with Hai Yan's people, but he couldn't care less because their gang was dead. He expressed his relief that those individuals did not touch Yin Mu. Su Ying inquired about Yin Mu but was cut off. When Cheng Dale assured them that Yin Mu would be fine after a good night's sleep as she was just a little tired. Hart told him not to forget to bring Yin Mu back because her soul was still damaged, and he should take her with him so she could always take care of her. Cheng Dale told the others not to tell anyone what happened because he planned to take Yin Mu to the village. After some time, a few cross-shaped woods were erected to the ground. A hand tied a piece of cloth into it. Yin Mu kneeled in front of a mound, and Cheng Dale and the others observed her. Yin Mu closed her eyes as if she were praying, thinking of a faraway place. Cheng Dale and the others continued to observe her. Yin Mu placed something on her mouth and thought about growing up with her mother's heartwarming singing where the stars were especially bright at night. She cried as she wondered who was calling her name, and stated that she was telling her mother that the child was going far away. After a while, a bird chirped. It flew. Yin Mu said to her mother that the child was going far away, where a voice told her they were going. 
Meanwhile, at the fallen Jade Village, Liu Jihan mumbled that as Cheng Dale ordered her, the horses were left in the fallen Jade Village to mount a cavalry. She complained about how annoying accounting was because she really wanted to see Cheng Dale. Liu Jihan stated that she came to the fallen Jade Village to greet Cheng Dale after hearing the news and was puzzled as to why he wasn't back even after the caravan returned. A voice outside repeatedly yelled that Cheng Dale was back. Liu Jihan's mood brightened as she chuckled. A scream addressing Cheng Dale greeted them. Liu Jihan embraced Cheng Dale with a warm hug as she addressed him. Cheng Dale asked her if she was a good girl, and Liu Jihan agreed. She turned around asking who the girl was. Cheng Dale introduced her to Yin Mu and informed her that he brought her back from the rings and that she would now be a member of the Toad Village. He asked Fan Lihua to let Yin Mu bathe and change her clothes first. Liu Jihan felt threatened as she questioned whether Cheng Dale brought a slave from the rings, and if she wasn't enough, that he had her. She imagined that she left Cheng Dale and wondered if he no longer wanted her. Su Ying looked at Liu Jihan, who was anxious and worried, and said nothing as she mumbled Cheng Dale's name. She was curious as to what Liu Jihan was thinking about this time. After a while, Fan Lihua bathed Yin Mu. Meanwhile, Cheng Dale praised the three lieutenants and stated that after the goods were exchanged for silver rations, they would divide them equally among the five villages, and assured the three lieutenants that they would not be mistreated. Yun Zhonglong stated that they would tolerate anything Cheng Dale did because he was righteous and eager to make money with their men. Su Ying asked Liu Jihan if she was jealous of Yin Mu, and Liu Jihan struggled to respond, and Cheng Dale told the three lieutenants that they should all prepare for their next trade, and asked if they could help him in collecting all possible current information from the area. Fan Lihua appeared, calling out Cheng Dale. She informed him that Yin Mu had been washed by her and was wearing her old clothes, and she asked if she could let her stay in the fallen Jade Village because she liked her. A voice asked someone if they wanted it, and another voice told that someone to wait and warned her not to touch his axe, because it was heavy. Liu Jihan's jaw was wide open as she said nothing. She noticed that Yin Mu carried the 108-pound ghost face axe on her back like it was nothing. Cheng Dale observed Yin Mu, who was feeling satisfied. He smiled as he thought that he had found a suitable owner for the axe. He told Yin Mu that from now on, the axe would be hers to use. After a while, about a month later, the construction of the level 3 toadstool was largely completed thanks to the improvement of the building skill, as there were dwellings, kitchens, forges, summoning platforms, weaving mills, and etc. The island was covered with arrow towers and was equipped with heavy crossbows, whereas the river at the edge of the island was littered with chain reefs, and only those who knew the code could get through the shallows. A voice told Cheng Dale to look at the information from various sources. Princess Minju informed him that he needed to distinguish between the real and fake. She informed him that a group of barbarians in the South China Sea came ashore and sold all kinds of strange and bizarre things. She also mentioned that the civil strife of the Ring tribe continued to break out and many princes fought to death. Princess Minju went on to say that Jin Wendao had completely stabilized his power in the western part of the grassland and was just around the corner from obtaining the throne, and she also mentioned that a demon had appeared somewhere. She went on to say that there was an uprising in Jiangnan by the Justice Cult, with over 100,000 followers, and that the Imperial Palace had begun to send troops to encircle and suppress the followers of such a cult, which prompted Cheng Dale to inquire about the Justice Cult. Princess Minju handed him papers and asked him to look at them because it was their foreign missionary teaching. According to legend, the Toad King was born from Pangu's left eye, which lived above the Moon Palace and the Red Snake Demon King was born in its right eye, which resided in the True Sun Temple, where the Toad King had been fighting the ferocious Red Snake Demon King for thousands of years. It stated that if the Toad King won, the weather would be favorable, and times could be peaceful and prosperous. However, if the snake won, the raging war would continue, and the people would live in dire poverty. Cheng Dale's eyes widened as he thought that the setting of the Toad and Snake looked familiar to him, just like Naruto X Sasuk, who he used to talk about. He continued reading, where 100 years ago, the Red Snake Demon King used a poisonous scheme to get the Toad King drunk on wine, and the blood descendants of the Red Snake Demon Skin sat in the Dragon Palace, where Cheng Dale continued it as he mumbled that it was the current Lai family now. He claimed that the followers of the Justice Cult believed in using their blood to defeat the Lai family, driving away the Red Snake, and awakening the Toad King. Cheng Dale also stated that it let him swallow the filth of the world with his huge mouth and return the light to Earth. He teased Princess Minju, saying he didn't expect her to be a beautiful snake, and asked if she knew how to bite, and she simply chuckled. Princess Minju blushed as she admitted that she still bit on occasion. 
She muttered under her breath that he didn't know. Cheng Dale expressed disappointment because he thought the justice cult was so great that they didn't even bother making up a myth, and he believed that it appeared to be just a bunch of illiterate mobs who couldn't achieve great things. And a little later Zhu Shenji appeared, calling out Cheng Dale. Zhu Shenji informed him that the restaurant had sent a sacred portrait of the justice cult and claimed that he would be stunned if he saw it. Princess Minju asked if it was the portrait of the god that the justice cult followers worshipped every day and Cheng Dale wondered if it could still scare him because he believed that there was nothing scarier he hadn't seen. Zhu Shenji placed the scroll he brought on the table and informed him it would be difficult to say. He instructed them to look as he unrolled the scroll. The three examined the contents and said nothing. An image of a frog was printed on it, leading Cheng Dale to question. His face darkened, and he cursed as he realized it was his toad flag. Cheng Dale instructed someone to bring him the toad flag. Zhu Shenji held the two scrolls, asking Cheng Dale if he liked them, prompting Princess Minju and Cheng Dale to question what he meant. Cheng Dale was irritated, wondering if those Justice Cult members were insane and what was wrong with them for creating the same logo for their toad flag. Princess Minju said nothing. He claimed that if there were a trademark protection law in place at the time, he would have sued them into bankruptcy. He told Zhu Shenji to hurry up and take down their toad flag, not to be so ostentatious about it. Enraged, Cheng Dale also ordered him to focus on collecting information about the Justice Cult because he wanted to see who had the guts to eat a bear's heart, which Zhu Shenji agreed to. A few days later, a large amount of information about the Justice Cult was placed on Cheng Dale's desk, and a voice reported that the cult rose up in Yangju in the last six months, and in just a short period of time. They gathered more than 100,000 believers. Cheng Dale mumbled that what was written on their banner was that the evil gods would descend, and justice would shine brightly. Princess Minju expressed that she didn't expect the cult's power to expand so quickly that even the Kinchuan had followers of the Justice Cult. She also mentioned that today's empire was riddled with holes and was in danger, and now that the cult of over 100,000 rebels had risen, she believed it would be the last straw that broke the camel's back. Cheng Dale asked her how she could say that so easily, reminding her that she used to be in a high position. Cheng Dale informed her that there were a few rebellions and dozens of rebels in the Dawu Empire every year, that there were people who couldn't survive and wanted to revolt and proclaim themselves as king, and most of them were killed in the cradle, which would not get anywhere. He stated that the so-called thin camels were bigger than horses, and just like the rabble of the Justice Cult, he believed that the program of action had to be supported by myth stories because he didn't think it would be possible to completely overthrow the Dao Empire. He went on to inform her that, according to the information their brothers had collected, the bottom of the Justice Cult hierarchy was the common people who were exploited by the landlords to the point where they could barely survive. He also mentioned the Shogun, who was the person who managed the believers at the bottom of the hierarchy, and the leader of the cult who was above the Shogun was the Supreme General, who was responsible for many things, however, they couldn't find his name. He went on to say that on the surface, the Supreme General was the supreme leader of the Justice Cult, leading Princess Minju to question him about what he meant by the surface. Cheng Dale explained that in the legend, the real leader of the Justice Cult was actually the supreme god behind the Supreme General and it was said that the Supreme General was the only disciple of the God, who was entrusted by heaven and blessed by immortals. He mentioned that there was little information about the Supreme God, whose name and origin were unknown. Cheng Dale claimed that it was said that the Supreme God was a capable person who could summon wind and rain, scatter beans and turn them into soldiers, and have so many believers in such a short period of time, which led him to believe that the person's ability, as well as hiding his identity, meant that his plan was not small. Princess Minju speculates that the Justice Cult developed so quickly that Emperor Ming couldn't ignore it, and Cheng Dale agrees and states that the Imperial Palace already sent people to encircle and suppress them. Cheng Dale claims that they couldn't let the Imperial Palace think that their Toad Village worked with the Justice Cult, and informs her that he will also change his nickname because the cult worshipped even the Toad King's name, prompting him to ask Princess Minju what she thinks is a better nickname for him. He mentions names like Jinchuan Tyrannosaurus, Invincible Tyrannosaurus, and Jade Wyvern because he thinks they should sound cool and stylish. Princess Minju suggests that he just call himself the Toad Hero, which prompts Cheng Dale to ask her why, and Princess Minju replies that in the story he told her, the hero was the one who saved the princess, which causes him to disagree because it was not cool enough. Day by day, late autumn is over and winter comes and the weather gets colder. As winter should be a day to rest and recuperate, Cheng Dale does not dare to idle around. 
he purchases 5,000 sets of winter clothing and bedding, which are distributed by Su Ying to all the brothers in the Toad Village, and taking time to bring Yin Mu to her biological mother's grave to offer incense, and kowtow, which completely settles Cheng Dale's worries. In addition to those trivial matters, there is also the daily army training, and also the sharpening of one's martial arts skills. Cheng Dale fights Zhao Zilong, Zhang Fei cheers for Zhao Zilong to do his best, and Liu Jihan cheers for Cheng Dale. Zhao Zilong thanks Cheng Dale for the battle, and Cheng Dale says nothing. He wipes his sweat and tells him that it is enough for that day. Cheng Dale notices something. He sees Kin Man and Fu Dale fighting. Kin Man hammers down his spear towards Fu Dale who struggles to block it. Cheng Dale ponders about the matchup, while a man beside him expresses how good Fu Dale is, saying that he was almost killed by Kin Man a few months ago, and now he can hold out for a few minutes. Fu Dale sits on the ground, exhausted. Kin Man holds out his hand and asks Fu Dele if he can still hold up. Fu Dele expresses his gratitude for Kin Man's guidance and suggests for him to come again. A system information about Fu Dele appears, who is 17 years old and has the skills of an elementary leader and saber skill, prompting Cheng Dale to recall that Fu Dele was more like a blank whiteboard the first time he saw him, but now he is a little stronger. He thinks daytime is for training, and nighttime is for studying with Princess Minju to improve the Toad Village system. Princess Minju informs Cheng Dale that Lai Zinzai is idling every day. She requests to let him teach people to read, as he is running around for the past days and wants to go to do business. She believes that it is now time to let him work. The next day, Lai Zinzai taught everyone to read and write. Lai Zinzai observed the chaos made by his students and said nothing. He claimed that it was much better to mine than to teach them to learn. And at the same time, Cheng Dale also closely watched the movements of the cult, and the Justice cult base was breached and suffered heavy casualties. The members scattered to flee, and the Justice cult was seriously damaged, prompting Cheng Dale to recall his previous statement that the Justice cult would not be able to achieve anything great. The village was noisy every day as the construction of the Level 3 Toad Village neared its completion. As winter approached, workers left one after another with their wages. Cheng Dale believed they would have a prosperous year with their money. A system notification appeared, stating that the Level 3 Village construction was completed, and the Level 3 Village had been reached. Another notification stated that a random village skill called Solid Defense had been rewarded, having the recovery time of village defenses, recruiting, and surrendering. Also, a rehabilitate skill had been rewarded. The system also informed that the host failed to improve his strength. Another notification stated the replacement of the special reward, which could randomly boost a person's hidden attributes. Cheng Dale was overjoyed that three village passive skills had been rewarded at once. He assumed that upgrading to a level 3 village did not improve his strength, but instead gave him such a reward. He thought hidden attributes were a good thing and wondered if he could use them to improve his own hidden attributes. He was about to press the system option stating that he could also choose to reappear hidden attributes that had disappeared. Cheng Dale questioned himself from being a good person to a great person, claiming that the special bonus with hidden attributes was clearly more useful than the skills. He used Su Ying's insight as an example and reasoned if he should give her the upgrade because he claimed that all people make mistakes, like the time he was in a hurry to give first aid. He assumed that Su Ying could also be stupid when she's in a hurry. He realized something about Su Ying's insight that continued to grow as he imagined Su Ying asking him where he had gone because he hadn't come back to bed the night before. He replied that he had gone to work all night. Su Ying leaned in closer and sniffed him. She told him she smelled lies because he had the rough scent of Liu Jihan, which prompted her to ask if he slept in her room the night before. This led to the present Cheng Dale saying nothing. When Cheng Dale realized Su Ying had a strong sense of oppression, his face froze, and he disagreed with himself that he couldn't use it on her. He kept thinking about the reward. He claimed that it could make hidden attributes that had disappeared reappear, and that if used correctly, it would be equivalent to remodeling oneself, claiming that he only needed to think about who he should use it for. Cheng Dale wondered if he should ask Hart for her opinion. Then, as he was reminded that in the past, Hart would always appear whenever the village was upgraded, he wondered why she didn't show up this time. Meanwhile, at the system space, as a voice felt relieved that it had finally been born, broken pieces began to float. Hart addressed the destiny sprite. Hart expressed her disappointment because she preferred having a good sister, but the sprite was actually a dragon. She wondered what name she should give the dragon. She stated that the essence of the country's destiny is for the unyielding souls of the soldiers who died for the country. The empire's soul was also the foundation of the country. Only the physical body dies, not the spirit. 
Only one strong soul dies a heroic death. She decided to call the dragon Guo Shang. Hart introduced herself and informed the dragon that she was its senior. They were now colleagues, and it should take care of her. A system option popped up, stating to click to transfer the console authority. After clicking, the system stated that the system store had been transferred. The system routine maintenance was working. Hart informed Guo Shang that there were no bugs in the two functions. She would leave that part of the work to him. The dragon remained silent, and a system notification appeared, requesting permission to transfer to the destiny sprite Guo Shang. As she hummed, Hart told him to work hard, and she would have more time to study the nature of the system in the future. Hart was overjoyed because she would have more time to play in the real world, read books, and play games without having to work overtime every day. She rejoiced and yelled that it was finally time for her liberation. A few days later, someone yelled for people to move and get out of the way. A carriage rushed by, with the driver warning everyone to move out of the way. Someone instructed the others to quickly take him to Liu Bei at the medical center. Someone also yelled to inform Cheng Dale that there was bad news. A voice mentioned that they all knew the descending Jade Village was the brother of the Toad Village and wondered why the Toad Village had changed their new clothes but her descending village still wore the old ones. Fan Li Hu expressed her irritation and told Cheng Dale that he could distinguish the center of the palm from the back of his hand. Cheng Dale responded that he forgot because he was really busy recently and got confused. He assured her that he would inform Su Ying, but their conversation was cut short when Gao Fei Bao appeared, yelling that he had bad news. Gao Fei Bao informed him that when they were purchasing foods in Heijia City, they had run into the Imperial soldiers who were besieging the Justice Cult. Two of their former brothers were involved and got seriously injured. He requested Cheng Dalei to go to the medical center. Meanwhile, at the medical center, a voice asked for Liu Bei. Cheng Dalei asked him which brother was injured and how the situation was. His expression was dark as he realized who it was. He screamed Lin Chong and Lin Shei Yu's names. A voice inquired of Gao Fei Bao how he came across both Lin Chong and Lin Shei Yu. Gao Fei Bao informed him that they were purchasing food in Heijia City when they saw officers suppressing the Justice Cult, and that although the fact that they were a lot of members, he claimed that they were all riffraff who were defeated in a short period of time, which made the followers scattered and running away. He went on to say that they saw Lin Shei Yu among the escaping followers and assumed he had joined the Justice Cult. Cheng Dale's face stiffened as he considered why Lin Shei Yu was so foolish. He inquired of Liu Bei on their conditions, and Liu Bei informed that it was not good. Liu Bei informed him that Lin Shei Yu's injury was serious, and that his shallow medical skills could only keep him alive, and that whether they would survive or not depended on fate. Cheng Dale cursed under his breath. He asked Gao Fei Bao if there were any famous doctors in Heijia City and instructed him to bring them all to cure them both. He also told him not to tell others about them joining the Justice Cult. Cheng Dale considered what Liu Bei had just said about fate and declared that he would not depend on fate, and that he might not even need to do anything. He asked for permission to enter the system space. Cheng Dale opened his eyes. As he stood on a glowing tile, he called the system. Cheng Dale asked for heart and if she was present. He requested for her to reply if she could hear him. A voice greeted him and said it was a pleasure to meet him. Cheng Dale realized it wasn't Hart's or the lottery machine's voice but rather an unfamiliar one, and he wondered who was responding to him. He turned around and was greeted by a shining jade dragon. Cheng Dale's eyes widened as he wondered if it was the second system sprite. The dragon did not respond, but Cheng Dale asked for its help in recovering Lin Shei Yu and Lin Chong's health, and the dragon informed him that he had insufficient authority to be able to do so, and asked him why he wanted to save them. Cheng Dale stated that there was no reason because he was simply saving people and asked the dragon if there was any medicine that could save them in the system shop if it couldn't save them directly. The dragon searched, and a system notification appeared, stating that the search had been completed and that 170 medicines that met the requirement had been found. Cheng Dale reasoned that the dragon gave such a stiff response and claimed that the dragon's distant and oppressive feeling is somehow familiar. The dragon asked him if he wanted it, and he agreed, and he realized that the feeling was also the same when he had a conversation with Emperor Ming in prison. The dragon prompted him to exchange, as the light faded away, and its real look appeared. Cheng Dale inquired what to exchange as he believed that it was bought using fear points, and the dragon disagreed with him. Guo Shang stated that he was born from the destiny of the Great Empire, and chose not to save the traitors who he desired to be saved. He said that he couldn't refuse him if he insisted on saving them, even though he wasn't willing to do so. 
However, he realized it was still his duty. That's why for a fair deal, he told Cheng Dalei that he would give him what he wanted and take away what he didn't want to lose. He asked him if he was willing to exchange. Confused, Cheng Dalei asked him what to exchange and thought that he couldn't definitely accept because if he accepted, he believed he would lose something important. Cheng Dalei didn't respond as Gu Shang pressured him to exchange or not. It teased him to forget it and mocked him for wanting to save two traitors, the so-called brothers of his. Guo Shang didn't stop mocking him, telling Cheng Dalei that he was ridiculous for starting to waver after knowing that he had to give up on something else. However, Cheng Dalei told him that he was annoying. Cheng Dalei stated that the Great Empire meant nothing to him, provoking Guo Shang to exchange whatever he wanted and rhetorically ask what if he wanted to save traitors. Cheng Dalei expressed that he didn't care if he lost something because if Lin Shei was dead, his life would be gone forever. He wondered what Guo Shang would take from him. Guo Shang granted his wishes, and a system notification appeared, informing him that two peerless grade medicines, the blood spirit pill, were exchanged. Guo Shang informed Cheng Dalei that in exchange, something would be taken away from him. A system notified Cheng Dalei that he lost the good person hidden attribute, and Guo Shang told him that he was an evil person in his eyes, while Cheng Dalei expressed that he felt as if a part of his soul was ripped off the moment his attribute was taken away. On the shelf, books were arranged, Hart read on a couch while lying down, Hart's face stiffened as she realized something. Guo Shang questioned what he meant by a good person, seeing him as nothing more than a mountain bandit who sheltered traitors, claiming that he did not deserve this hidden attribute. Guo Shang also mentioned throwing away the empire's greater good for trivial matters. As a shining orb shone on Guo Shang's hands, he declared that he would destroy it. Cheng Dalei sweated and gritted his teeth. Heart suddenly appeared above them, wielding a massive hammer. She descended as she held the hammer with both of her hands. Heart swung her hammer on top of Guo Shang's head, threatening him to eat it. A massive explosion was heard when Guo Shang forcefully descended to the ground. Cheng Dalei addressed Heart's name. Hart found it strange as she wondered if she had asked the lottery machine to teach Guo Shang and also asked Cheng Dalei how he came across Guo Shang. She questioned Guo Shang for daring to use the dragon power against Cheng Dalei, not only because it was unfamiliar with its job, but also because it was foolish and narrow-minded, wondering if Guo Shang's brain was fried from being worshipped in the shrine for a hundred years. She went on and warned Guo Shang that if he knew that Cheng Dalei didn't have the attribute, he would have a completely different path in the future. Hart assured Cheng Dalei that she would give him back his attribute, and Guo Shang threatened her if she dared to, and Hart grumbled Guo Shang almost cost her some big problem just because she didn't give him some whacking. And a system notified that the good person's hidden attribute had been acquired, leading to Cheng Dalei asking Hart if there was anything that he could do. Hart told him there was no need and told him to take the medicine and go save Lin Sheyu and Lin Chong. She explained what she had previously stated, that she would deal with special matters, and that the mundane one was what he had to do. She instructed him to continue building up his mountain village and exploring the world by completing the mission to make the mountain village stronger, and she assured him that the system would also grow, which would help him become stronger as well. She told Cheng Dalei that she had a feeling the world would become chaotic soon after going through the White Snake and Yin Mu's matter, and that it wasn't just chaos because there were many deviants causing mischief in between. She warned him that this type of unusual matter was not something that humans could deal with. Hart assured him that she would help him deal with troubles that a normal human couldn't deal with. As Guo Shang charged at her, she flew towards the dragon and said something to Cheng Dalei. She slammed the hammer on Guo Shang's face and told him that his comrades who depended on each other and connected souls should do. Hart claimed that it was a crucial point in changing the world. As the two system sprites fought, Cheng Dalei and the lottery observed them without saying a word. Cheng Dalei realized that they were truly deities fighting each other. The lottery machine argued what he meant by fighting, as it was just a one-sided whacking, stating that Hart was angry because she had been watching for so long before the dragon was even born. But Guo Shang almost ruined the whole thing the moment it took over. Cheng Dalei inquired what was the deal with Guo Shang, and the lottery machine explained to him that the Empire's destiny was created from the brave warriors' sacrifices from the war. However, he now doubted it. He went on to say that the brave soul's sacrifices for the great empire were decreasing, while their bureaucracy was flourishing. He claimed that the empire was ill, which caused Guo Shang to be born from its destiny to become like that. The lottery machine filled him up with more information that Guo Shang got worshipped for hundreds of years by the commoners before it even took form, which caused it to be arrogant, while Hart slammed her hammer on Guo Shang telling him to eat it. 
The lottery machine stated that when Guo Shang had just been born, it didn't get the situation and still dared to act like shit in front of Hart, and he revealed his true nature the moment she left. Hart continued whacking Guo Shang. The lottery machine also stated that Hart wouldn't be lenient when it comes to beating those types of idiots who like to abuse power or want to dominate others' fate. Concerned, Cheng Dale asked if Hart wouldn't beat Guo Shang to death, as he noticed he was becoming smaller from all the beatings, and the lottery machine replied that Hart was still expecting Guo Shang to take over a part of the job so she could travel with him. The lottery machine stated that Hart surely didn't hold back, as she even broke the dragon's horn and he remembered how even more brutal she was when she hit him a few years back. Hart sighed in exhaustion while holding some of Guo Shang's hair on her hand. She asked Cheng Dale if his soul was alright and informed him that ripping off an attribute forcefully could cause some damage. She addressed the lottery machine, reminding him that she had asked him to teach Guo Shang how to do the job and inquired as to how it came across Cheng Dale. Cheng Dale assured that he was fine and the lottery machine struggled to answer her. Annoyed, Hart wondered if the lottery machine was slacking off to play games again. The lottery machine felt scared as he continuously struggled to answer her. He changed the topic and held two balls in his hand, informing Cheng Dale that it was the medicine pill that he wanted. The lottery machine told him to take it to save people and informed him that the medicine wouldn't taste good once it cools off, and Cheng Dale understood. He informed him that the peerless grade pill was a single pill that cost 1 million fear value and thanked him for doing business, and Cheng Dale was surprised at how expensive it was, and a system notification popped up, stating that his fear value had been deducted for 2 million, leaving him with 1,531,814 fear value. A hand held the two medicines. It came close to Lin Sheyu's mouth, making him take them. Three days later, a voice yelled at Cheng Dale, informing him that Lin Sheyu woke up. Cheng Dale ordered Kin Man and the others to go back for a while, as there were some things he wanted to discuss with them alone, and they agreed. Lin Sheyu addressed Cheng Dale, and Cheng Dale told him not to get up until he was healed. Cheng Dale inquired if he had grown up and remembered what he told him about his desire to retire from official life. Lin Sheyu addressed Cheng Dale who assured him that they weren't going to talk about it further. Cheng Dale told them that they should have come to him a long time ago because he had a large territory on the island and could afford to care for one more person. But he claimed that they were eager to join a church of justice instead, and Lin Sheyu replied that they had lost this time. Lin Sheyu informed him that they should not have started so early, and that if they had another year or two to gather strength, they would not have lost as badly as they did. Cheng Dale paused and said nothing. He asked Lin Sheyu how they came to join the Church of Justice. Lin Sheyu hesitated to respond and looked at Lin Chong, who remained silent. Cheng Dale continued to interrogate them asking what was their status in the Church of Justice as he assumed if they could be a high-ranking official, and Lin Sheyu wanted to say something but stopped. Cheng Dale, on the other hand, asked another question if they were headed to a place, and if so, he believed that it was a good position, and Lin Sheyu shook his head for an answer. Cheng Dale was surprised as he learned that they were not a key player, which again Lin Sheyu shook his head. Cheng Dale expressed relief and instructed them to tell him the truth about their position in the Church of Justice. He guessed whether they were a divine lord, divine general head, or leader, as he informed them that it wasn't like he didn't know anything about the Church of Justice. Lin Sheyu and Lin Chong looked at each other and said nothing. Lin Sheyu informed him that he was neither the head nor the leader of the Church of Justice, and assured him that he was not lying. Lin Sheyu revealed that he was the one who originally created it. Cheng Dale's eyes widened in surprise. He laughed and told Lin Sheyu not to be ridiculous because he knew him well. Lin Sheyu looked him dead in the eyes. Cheng Dale inquired Lin Sheyu about the Church of Justice, which he was cut off in the middle of his sentence. Lin Sheyu revealed that he was a divine general. A system information appeared, stating Lin Sheyu's background, whose age was 21 and had the experience of the divine general of the Church of Justice. Shocked, Cheng Dale had a thought that the vague feeling of an evil premonition becomes more and more intense, as he couldn't express his disbelief about the divine lord Lin Sheyu said. He struggled to complete his sentence about the Church of Justice. Lin Sheyu pointed at him and told him that it was him. Cheng Dale's jaw dropped as he couldn't believe what he had heard. After calming down a bit, a voice inquired them to tell him more about it, and asked what the Church of Justice was all about. Lin Sheyu informed him about his father, who was killed by Emperor Ming, and as his son, the revenge for the murder of his father must be carried out. 
However, the emperor was hiding inside, and he had the protection of the fish dragon guards. He claimed that he couldn't kill him even if he was the best martial artist in the world, which led to Cheng Dale assuming that was why he wanted to have more people. Lin Sheyu said that due to years of war, the prosperous regions south of the river were now also suffering from constant exploitation by the government. Many people lived a life worse than dogs and were willing to follow if given hope. He added that the Church of Justice, where they preached everywhere in Yangzhou, had already amassed more than 100,000 believers in less than a year. They fought a few battles against the rich and won all of them. Cheng Dale claimed that the Church of Justice did not seem to be formed by him, such as raising a team of people in six months and using propaganda and other methods. He asked if someone else helped him. Lin Sheyu informed him that indeed one more person was involved. He had met Guo Fanren, a Taoist, and asked if Cheng Dale remembered him. Cheng Dale confirmed if it was the two Taoists, one old and one young, who held the white flag with a message to see through the human world. Lin Sheyu agreed and informed him that they were the ones who had rescued him from the heavenly prison. Guo Fanren also helped them set up the Church of Justice. He claimed that the Taoist was somehow influential, and without him, they could not have achieved such great things. Cheng Dale asked what the Church of Justice wanted to do in the end, and if it was simply to take revenge. Lin Sheyu inquired if Cheng Dale remembered what he said when they first met. He reminded him that he had told him he had an idea, just as Cheng Dale had said he would save those in need. Lin Sheyu reminded him that he would break the old world to build a new one. Cheng Dale agreed, stating that he still remembered and had started to try already. Cheng Dale informed him that the Toad Village was introducing a new system, eradicating illiteracy, allocating fields so that everyone had enough to eat, and distributing labor according to needs. He explained that personal safety would be provided first, followed by food and clothing, and finally, the people's intelligence would be slowly developed. Lin Sheyu's face stiffened, and he asked Cheng Dale if he had not understood. He expressed that the world had been hopeless for a long time, with the rich being unkind, the powerful mostly degenerates, and the thieves and bandits evil. He asked how many people Cheng Dale thought suffered every day in the empire. He stated that the great dynasty was full of people who were like dogs and flies. One word from the emperor, and they appointed a coward to become a god of war. For the sake of profit, they could insult the souls of those who died for their country, as the rings had repeatedly violated the border, and the empire had lost 10 out of 10 battles. Lin Sheyu expressed that his Lin's clan fought hard to resist the rings, and in the end, they were betrayed by nine clans. He wondered where justice and righteousness were when the Lin family's graves were dug up, and the bones were left in the wilderness to be eaten by vicious dogs, and in a world that now cursed the Lin family. Lin Sheyu stated that the royal family was the only cause of all, that as long as Emperor Ming existed in the world. He claimed there could be no justice in the world. A black flag with a red circle drawn on it was raised. Lin Sheyu expressed that even if he involved the whole world in war, he would exterminate the emperor and reasoned that only justice would shine brightly in the world. Cheng Dale yelled his name. Lin Sheyu's eyes were on fire, making Cheng Dale realize the little light in Sheyu's pupils. He argued that it wasn't light, but fire. Cheng Dale claimed that the fire was about to burn, and it was burning. He stated that Sheyu was the fire phoenix wrapped in vengeful fury and wondered if his fire would sweep the whole world. Cheng Dale asked Hart what the system would be like if he chose to let Toad Village join the Justice Cult. Hart informed him that if he joined the cult, she would need to adjust the system's function from mountain bandit to insurgent army, and during that period, the system would not be accessible, and the operation would be irreversible, and that so far he built a level 3 village, claiming that his men were reshuffled. She also informed him that some people would leave him, such as the Lai brothers and sister, as well as some brothers who did not want to be rebels, prompting Cheng Dale to declare that the price was far too high. When Lin Sheyu told him that there were brothers all over the world, and that the cult respected him, he had 100,000 followers, and as long as he gave the order, they would follow it. Cheng Dale ignored him advising him to get well and told him not to think so much, as they would talk about the rest later, assuring him that he was still his brothers, and Lin Sheyu just addressed him. Lin Sheyu informed him that they had come to ask him to come out, and that if he gave the order, Hundreds of thousands of people would be under his subsidiaries, and the world would be his, which led to Cheng Dale's disagreement as he must not go on the same path as the cult. He thought that judging from Lin Sheyu's leadership skills, he hardly considered what to do after the revolution was successful, and even if he took over the command, he was not sure that he could control a group of strange men in a short time. 
The huge amount of hatred had turned Lin Xiao Yu into a fire phoenix that set the prairie ablaze, as he wanted to burn the great kingdom's royal family into ashes and finally burn up together with them himself. Cheng Dalei wondered what happened after that. That once Emperor Ming died, he believed many warlords would certainly rise, and another chaotic world of wars and constant suffering for people. Cheng Dalei claimed that the people would be able to resume farming and the tenacious weeds would sprout from the ashes until one of the warlords won and a new king took over the throne. He expressed that in the end, nothing had changed as it was still a great kingdom, and that the people of the world were just changing to a new master to worship. Cheng Dale claimed that one should be prepared because killing Emperor Ming was still difficult, and ruling the country was even more difficult, as the world would be meaningless. He wondered if they had to repeat it for a hundred years until the Far West opened its doors with the roar of the Industrial Revolution, and repeated the same story of his previous life. Cheng Dale was surprised at how frightening the silk stockings and binoculars had appeared in the West, and their industrial production level. He dozed off and just stared. Cheng Dalei wiped his forehead and said nothing. When he realized it was snowing, he believed he had a long way to go and declared that he would seek and explore everything from top to bottom. Liu Jihan appeared, telling Cheng Dalei to quickly get back to the house because it was snowing and he would catch a cold, which Cheng Dalei understood. She asked Cheng Dalei to stay with her tonight because she had asked someone to go to the city and buy a good thick goose feather bed and convinced Cheng Dalei that it was soft and warm. After a while, the bitter winter and the first winter snowfall were ushered in Toad Village. The literacy and military classes were held simultaneously at the Toad Village, with training during the day and classes at night. Cheng Dale was in charge of the military class. He instructed his students that fighting against the enemy was like regulated water. If the enemy had strong momentum, they must avoid the impact, and they must use methods such as using diversion to divert the flow. Liu Jihan had a thought that everyone was waiting for Cheng Dalei to finish his class. Cheng Dalei went on to say that for a weak enemy, seizing the opportunity to destroy him was similar to building a dam to keep water from flowing away. He noticed Lin Sheyu. Cheng Dalei expressed regret for not being able to accompany him on his path to raise the revolution flag, which he was determined to do, but he would just teach him something else because he believed he must survive, whether he succeeds or not. He wondered how far Lin Sheyu would go in the future, and whether it was all a blessing or a curse for him. While telling his students about the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty, and about the Yellow Turban Army Revolution, Lin Sheyu focused on reading the book, while Cheng Dale stated that under the written notes on his slogan of Zhang Jiao, the Empire's power would disappear, and the Yellow Turban Army would rise, and the cycles of 60 years would be prosperous. Cheng Dale went on to inform them that the reason for failure was that they couldn't get the support of local tyrants and had poor discipline, and the leader couldn't restrain his subordinates, so it easily split. While behind Lin Sheyu was Fu Delay who was focused on reading. After a while, a water wheel was seen. Zhu Yi informed Cheng Dale that she, along with other craftsmen, had built the water wheel according to his idea. She claimed that using the water wheel they could irrigate fields of a dozen acres in a day. Zhu Yi expressed her disappointment that they built it at the wrong time, as the river was also frozen. She stated that they would have to wait until next spring to use it. Cheng Dale reasoned that the frozen river was thick enough for horses to pass through. He realized that the Toad Village had lost its geographical advantage of the Water Island, and that all of their river defenses had disarmed as of now. He expressed his concern that Mo Mingmi would take the opportunity, but he also wondered why no news of the attack had yet arrived, and Zhu Shenji arrived calling out for Cheng Dale. Zhu Shenji informed him that the New Year's Eve was approaching, and he wanted to go to the descending Jade Village to pick up Xiao Linger. He requested if he could arrange for someone to accompany him. Cheng Dale agreed and instructed him to go to Gao Fei Bao and ask for his assistance. He also told him to pass his order to strengthen security around the area and send more spies to find out what was going on at the Kinchuan border, which Zhu Shenji agreed to. He and I asked Mo Mingmi when they should start because the time and place were favorable, and Mo Mingmi replied that they should wait two days until the frozen river became stronger, and that the heavy armor army they borrowed from Lord Kui would also be trained by then. A soldier rushed in, yelling that he had urgent news to report to Mo Mingmi. The soldier yelled, informing Mo Mingmi that the scouts had just sent important news. He reported that Zhu Shenji left for descending Jade Village an hour ago. Mo Mingmi smirked as he realized that the time and place had finally come, as well as the last person. He believed that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Mo Mingmi instructed them to pass on his orders to prepare the troops, including the 18 lieutenants, and anyone absent would be executed first. 
He ordered them to attack the Toad village at dawn the next day. He also summoned Mu Changjiang and ordered him to take 2,000 men and march on the descending Jade village to guard the perimeter of the fortress, and instructed him not to attack and to depend only on trapping Zhu Shenji. Mu Changjiang assured Mo Mingmi, stating that he would definitely live up to his expectations. Mo Mingmi predicted that the battle would be bound to be difficult, and the final battle, and that the outcome would decide who would be the leader of Kinchuan where he had information on all their numbers, where the descending Jade Village had a population of 300 plus, and that the attacking Mu Changjiang outnumbered them with his 2,000, while the Toad Village had 5,000, and Mo Mingmi and the 18 lieutenants combined had 20,000 troops. At the descending Jade Village, a voice yelled that the enemy had attacked, and instructed their brothers to get ready to fight them. Zhu Shenji was perplexed, claiming that the village was much further from the Kinchuan border than the Toad Village, and he also wondered why they had brought all their men so far around to fight the descending Jade Village. A cavalry in front didn't say anything as Mu Chengzheng lined up his men in the back. A man next to Mu Chengzheng asked when they would attack, and he mocked him. Meanwhile, on Zhu Shenji's side, family Hua stated that she had heard that Zhu Shenji was a good strategist, so he asked him to tell them how they should fight, and he didn't respond. Zhu Shenji had a vision of Cheng Dalei advising him that if he wasn't around and someone asked him for advice, he should first hang on and not do nothing and say anything, and he understood. Mu Changjiang expressed his difficulties as his task was extremely hard to accomplish, and wondered how he could be enough in front of Zhu Shenji with the number of men he brought. Mu Changjiang informed his men that their task was to stall Zhu Shenji, and instructed them to set camp and not act rashly, while on Zhu Shenji's side, he instructed them to wait and see how the other side would attack first, and decide whether or not to defend, and a voice praised him for his brilliance. Both sides were wondering what they should do next. Back to the Toad Village, the rings were good at cavalry field battles, while the Empire was good at heavy weaponry siege, and this time, the river was frozen and the people were able to move freely, so the heavy weapons could be transported directly to the island. Cheng Dale had no choice but to retreat to the village, and a voice yelled that the enemy was coming and instructed everyone to attack. On Mo Mingmi's side, soldiers yelled at the shield soldiers to cover the ladders. Tin Man informed them that the giant crossbow team was in position. Someone yelled that the crossbows were loaded and a voice ordered them to release as their target was the soldiers pushing the siege chariot. Soldiers began their climb to the walls, while a barrage of arrows and rocks descended upon them. Toad village archers were ordered to release their arrows. A voice yelled at them to leave no one behind and beat them all down. Mo Mingmi attacked several times without success, and ten days later, the attackers lost thousands of men, but no one could break through the walls of the Toad village. Judging from the war for the last few days, the combat power of Mo Mingmi's soldiers was very average. Lai Zingzai inquired as to what was going on and how he could defend a city at that level, and Cheng Dalei replied that according to his information, those who attacked them in the previous few days were from the army of the 18 lieutenants, and he believed that no matter how heavy their casualties were, the death of those soldiers would not hurt Mo Mingmi. Cheng Dalei claimed that the Kinchuan border still had a hidden elite unit, and that Mo Mingmi had not used his real cards yet prompting Lai Zingzai to ask if there were any hidden explosives in the village because he was so confident. Cheng Dalei informed him that they were out of explosives, and Lai Zingzai laughed, and Cheng Dalei had thought that after finishing the mission this time, he wouldn't use explosives for the time being because he assumed that if he used explosives, they wouldn't dare to fight. Lai Zingzai noticed how Cheng Dalei was dressed so casually and asked him if he was not afraid of becoming a target, and he replied that Su Ying embroidered the dress for him and asked Lai Zingzai if he wanted it. Part appeared and presented herself, followed by a mission notification indicating that the current mission progress to complete a village ten times was nine tenths. Meanwhile at Mo Mingmi army camp, Yan Dai reported that those ten days were considered good, and they had at least reached the bottom of the Toad village. He claimed that the situation was more positive, and he informed Mo Mingmi that the gunpowder they had been fighting with for so long wasn't still being used by them. He assumed that it had all been used up, which was great news for them. Mo Mingmi agreed, and stated that the Toad Village was completely different without Zhu Shenji. Yan Dai stated that without Zhu Shenji, the Toad Village could be broken, and if they wanted to completely destroy them, he believed they would have to lose a lot of manpower. He went on to say that it was also a good opportunity to weaken the 18 lieutenant's strength, claiming that no one would be left to grow and be strong. 
Yan Dai advised Mo Mingmi to begin with the three lieutenants, Yun Zhongguang, Kai He, and Yu Jilu, claiming that due to the recent attacks, the three of them always worked without any effort, and he expressed his concern that they had been long rebellious. Mo Mingmi stated that he recently placed them in Cheng Dale's sphere of influence and wondered if they truly believed they were his people. Yan Dai inquired if they should get rid of those three. Mo Mingmi told him that there was no need for that, as killing generals in a war was detrimental to the soldiers' morale. He stated that in the next attack, he would let the three of them take the lead and that if they refused to go, he would behead them for disobeying the military order, and that if they were willing to go, he would let Cheng Dale clean them up. Yan Dai asked what if they turned their backs on them, and Mo Mingmi chuckled, not knowing what he meant, and wondering if Cheng Dale would accept them. Mo Mingmi believed that the three of them were the bricks that would pry open the gate for them, and that if Cheng Dale accepted them, they would open the city gate for them, and the city would be destroyed. Mo Mingmi directed that all 18 lieutenants be summoned. Frustrated, Mo Mingmi grew angry with his 18 lieutenants as they were still unable to conquer Toad Village even after half a month passed. He believed them all capable enough of the task. He calls Zhonglong, Kaiohi, and Yu Jialu to inquire if they have any excuses. Nervous, Zhonglong claimed that it was not due to their incapability, but Cheng Dale was just too cunning. Doubtful, Mo Mingmi questioned Zhonglong's words about Cheng Dale being too cunning. He suggested that perhaps deep down, they all felt favorably towards Cheng Dale and sought confirmation. Mo Mingmi informed them that he heard they were living quite well by following Cheng Dale recently. Anxious, Zhonglong attempted to make another excuse, but he bowed his head and persuaded Mo Mingmi, vowing loyalty and assuring him that he would not side with Cheng Dale and would not dare have any disloyalty. Mo Mingmi chuckled with satisfaction, expressing his belief that they were only following Cheng Dale due to the circumstances. Acknowledging their situation, Mo Mingmi ordered the three to lead the main assault for tomorrow's fight. He informed the other lieutenants that they would soon conquer Toad Village, cautioning them not to slack off. Bowing in response, Yu Jialu and Zhonglong expressed their determination. Zhonglong made it clear that he would not disappoint Mo Mingmi, vowing to conquer Toad Village even if it meant risking their lives. After their meeting, the discussion continued among the 18 military lieutenants at their camping site. Yu Jialu criticized Mo Mingmi for being unreasonable, stating that he did not know that conquering Toad Village was hard. He emphasized why Mo Mingmi wouldn't go fight himself but expected them to risk their lives. Annoyed, Kaio he pointed out that they were providing their army provisions and weapons, emphasizing that Mo Mingmi hadn't even provided food and daily items, highlighting that men were dying every day, and he questioned where in the world this was not unreasonable. Zhonglong urged them to lower their voices, reminding them that they were in Mo Mingmi's territory and warning them to be careful not to be overheard by others. Pleading with Zhonglong, Kaio he asked what they should do the next day. Zhonglong responded that the ones who knew the most about Toad Village were the three of them. He pointed out that Kin Man, Xilong, and a few others were all people who could take on hundreds of men by themselves. He questioned what they could use to fight against them, highlighting the difficulty of just putting their heads inside weapons. He emphasized that if there were no other way, they would have to withdraw and expressed his unwillingness to die for Mo Mingmi. Yu Jialu questioned the idea of withdrawal, asking where they could go since all places around Kinchuan were considered Mo Mingmi's territory. With a serious face, Zhonglong confirmed the issue, stating that they couldn't simply give up on their business and become losers. However, he emphasized the danger of going outside Kinchuan's mountain pass, considering Mo Mingmi's temper. If they were caught, he feared not even their bone would be left. Kaio he sighed in response, expressing the opinion that if Cheng Dale were the boss of the place, their lives would likely be much better. Yu Jialu agreed, believing that helping Cheng Dale could be considered righteous as long as they help him. He wouldn't disregard their hard work compared to Mo Mingmi, whom he seriously considered a scum. However, Yu Jialu questioned if Cheng Dale could win this time. Kaio he admitted uncertainty but mentioned hearing that Mo Mingmi had borrowed an elite from the superiors who had yet to show his capabilities and asked Zhonglong for his insight. Zhonglong, mumbling to respond, the two urged him to stop mumbling and share his ideas about whether they should follow Cheng Dale this time. Then, Zhonglong suggested that Mo Mingmi might be hiding a trump card and questioned whether they believed Cheng Dale couldn't be doing the same thing. Curious, they asked him to clarify. Zhonglong explained that they only saw Kin Man defending Toad Village, and strong fighters like Xilong, Zhang Fei, and Guan Yu had yet to join the fight. He believed Cheng Dale was intentionally holding back on purpose, expressing that he didn't know what motive Cheng Dale had for doing so. Zhonglong dismissed the notion that Cheng Dale might be afraid that his men were too strong to the point of beating Mo Mingmi until he ran away. 
giving the example that even the Ring clan with a hundred thousand men was nothing to Cheng Dalei. He emphasized that Mo Mingmi's attack shouldn't be a threat to Cheng Dalei. Shocked, they questioned Zhonglong's claim of a hundred thousand Ring clan members. Zhonglong confirmed it, acknowledging that many people thought it was fake. He urged them to consider the truth. When he heard of the battle record, he got curious, emphasizing where Mo Mingmi dared to fight Cheng Dalei. At most, he could only be seen as an oversized stone blocking the road. He added that Mo Mingmi had always been a mountain bandit, and now he seemed to have gone crazy, acting as an emperor at Kinchuan Mountain Pass with backing from Qi Yang. Hai he and Yu Jialu reacted with exaggerated disbelief, questioning how they were supposed to fight Cheng Dalei the next morning. They expressed concern that it seemed like a dead end. Acknowledging the gravity of the situation, Zhonglong reminded them that if they wanted to live, they should follow his lead the next day. He emphasized that the information discussed that night should never be leaked outside, no matter what. Deep at night, a carrier pigeon flew across the night sky. The next day before the morning fog even dispersed, as the sound of war drums went off, Mo Mingmi once again launched an attack. Zhonglong, Kaiohi, and Yu Jialu, three of them took off standing at the foreguard. As the enemy marched closer to the Toad Village, Xing Zai halted them and announced Cheng Dalei's presence. He asked them to lower their weapons, assuring them that Cheng Dalei would be benevolent and would let them all off. However, the opposing side instructed them to keep going and not dilly-dally. Nervous, Yu Jialu asked Zhonglong what they should do. In the face of tension, Zhonglong explained that Cheng Dalei's words were a signal and replied to follow his lead. Again, Xing Zai warned them to throw their weapons on the ground. Suddenly, Zhonglong swiftly discarded his weapon and ran fast toward Cheng Dalei's village, surprising Yu Jialu and Kaiohi with his actions. Xing Zai shouted at Zhonglong to put his hands up and showcase a certain traditional skill from a foreign country, as Cheng Dalei had instructed. Terrified, Zhonglong raised his hands while running, declaring his willingness to surrender, and insisting that they were willingly giving up. Frightened, Zhonglong kept repeating that they were giving up while Yu Jialu was also following behind, raising his hands, and pleading for mercy since they had surrendered. Their soldiers followed them, running in panic, causing others to stumble and fall. Bewildered, Xing Zai warned Cheng Dalei to be careful, suspecting it could be one of their tricks, while Cheng Dalei just stood beside him. Cheng Dalei responded, assuring Xing Zai that there was no need to worry. He already discussed everything with Zhonglong, leading them, and they were prepared to take them in. He ordered his archers to release arrows to cover Zhonglong's soldiers during their retreat. At the gate, Zhonglong's soldiers anxiously urged them to hurry up and open it, instructing others to enter fast. As they entered Cheng Dalei's village, some of Zhonglong's soldiers expressed gratitude to Cheng Dalei. One even vowed loyalty to him, claiming they would never stand alongside Mo Mingmi, while the rest of his soldiers continued thanking Cheng Dalei. However, the villagers responded sternly, dismissing the nonsense. They decided to capture everyone and lock them up in prison, promising to discuss matters after the war. And some villagers scolded the Zhonglong soldiers, warning them not to run around. Other villagers advised their companion to keep Zhonglong's soldiers under control, cautioning that those who disobeyed would be treated as spies and executed immediately. Back to the war, on the opponent's side, Mo Mingmi was filled with rage and saw this as an opportunity moment, mentioning that he patiently waited for Cheng Dalei to open the gate. Driven by determination, he commanded his cavalry to break down the gate and ordered his troops to launch an attack on the city. Mo Mingmi declared that whoever successfully broke down the gate would receive a reward of a hundred gold bars and a promotion to a military officer. His troops were resolute in their decision to attack. The soldiers brought ladders while directed them to occupy and seize the gate. Meanwhile, Cheng Dalei, equally determined, ordered Kin Man and Man Zijun to go outside the city and face the enemy. He also called Zai Long and Zhang Fei, instructing them to prepare for battle. After the last surrendered soldier got inside the city gate, Zai Long and the others who had been on standby at the gate fiercely took off. Upon exiting their gate, Zhang Fei urged everyone to fight fiercely and block off any pursuers. Kin Man, equally resolute, shouted with determination, encouraging his men to showcase the training they underwent in the Toad Village, and emphasized that they let Cheng Dalei witness their achievements. After defending for half a month, the first time Cheng Dalei chose to take the offensive stance, to directly fight off the root of the problem, Cheng Dalei prepared to take Mo Mingmi's head to bring an end to the mission of defending the village ten times. Eighteen military lieutenants' troops have been dispersed by Toad Village. Leading the charge, Zhang Fei, Zilong, and Kin Man took the forefront, 
shouting orders to kill and urging their men to go on and instructing their men to change in a trident formation. Amid the action, Zhang Fei expressed his excitement to be the one to take down Mo Mingmi. Smirking, Xilong responded that they would see who could claim Mo Mingmi's head first. Meanwhile, Kin Man remarked that Cheng Dale finally granted them to fight. The three platoons went directly towards Mo Mingmi's main army. The three leaders shouted for their men to follow their lead and yelled commands to kill. They divided into three squads, Kin Man's squad, Xilong's squad, and Zhang Fei's squad. The three platoons arranged as a trident, destroying everything in their path and sweeping up everything. Meanwhile, an evil intent was evident on Mo Mingmi's face as he displayed a smirk. He instructed his troops to retreat and let Cheng Dale's men break in. On Cheng Dale's side, as he used his telescope, he wondered why Mo Mingmi were not scattering but instead retreating in an orderly fashion. He pondered the reason behind Mo Mingmi's continuous retreat. The forces are drawing back like a tide. Following that, they revealed the thing they had been hiding. While Cheng Dale observed through his telescope, shocked visibly on his face as he spotted a heavily armored soldier in the distance, numbering around 5,000. Concerned, he questioned if those were Mo Mingmi's hidden cards. At the same time, Zhang Fei, now close to the armored soldiers, commanded his men to go after Mo Mingmi, who was just behind the battle formation. They all shouted kill, believing that capturing Mo Mingmi's head would automatically break apart. Their determination was unwavering. The armored soldiers were ready. Zhang Fei attacked one of them but was easily blocked and expelled. He tried to stab again but quickly realized the thickness of their armor. He contemplated that despite delivering two direct attacks, the armored soldier was only knocked down. Suddenly, Yan Dai issued commands to the front troops, urging them to do everything to hold off the enemy. The two cavalry troops were instructed to surround the opponents from both sides. The second and third teams were instructed to be on the left, slowed down, and joined in. He told them to spread out in the battle formation. Using the heavily armored soldiers as a shield against the trident's sharp edge, Yan Dai ordered them to follow by encirclement, spread out, and surround them. Cheng Dale realized the tactical prowess of luring the enemy by acting weak and using heavy armored soldiers to block the cavalry charge. He expressed that Yan Dai's was something else. He issued orders to his troops to retreat, preventing them from being wrapped up like dumplings. As their drums sounded and ordered the troops to retreat, Kin Man and Zhang Fei turned their heads as they received the command to fall back. Cheng Dale instructed that all the troops retreat and that the front group change into the vanguard group. Xilong turned to Kin Man and Zhang Fei, informing them that they held off the enemy while sending the troops back to the village. They repeatedly instructed them to retreat. The encirclement is yet to be formed. The three troops efficiently broke away from the blockage. Cheng Dale issued a command to archers to release the arrows to cover those who were retreating. It was another siege that continued for a whole day. In the end, after abandoning a few hundred corpses, Mo Mingmi temporarily retreated. Suddenly, a beep sounded that the mission for defending the mountain village ten times was completed, and some defenses completed, ten over ten. After the earlier war, as night fell in Toad Village at Cheng Dale's study room, he complained about the mission that had persisted for several months in a row. They fought major battles, and now, finally, it was completed. Miserable as he recalled how he had been happy and comfortable when the system bug provided the defense mission, while Hart was by his side, listening to his frustration. She spoke up, stating that the stuck bug mission was too much to handle, so it was repaired to prevent it from getting stuck again. Hart explained that the method of issuing rewards had been changed from providing rewards upon completion to completing the mission ten times to receive all the rewards, highlighting that it would be hard to get stuck on a bug now. Suddenly, a beep from the system congratulated Cheng Dale on completing the defense mission ten times and asked him if he wanted to receive the rewards. Hart highlighted that the mission was completed and the rewards would not be bad. She persuaded Cheng Dale to collect the reward, which Cheng Dale clicked to receive them. A repeating beep followed, and the rewards he got included five battle flags, ten acres of farmland, good wine, a long sword, clothes and herbs, fifty pounds of grain, and a special reward, a new battle song. Hart informed Cheng Dale that when the battle song was used, he would lose all his fear points. She advised him to spend all his fear points before utilizing the song. Flustered by the information, Cheng Dale questioned the kind of song that required him to spend all his fear points. Hart clarified that it's not about spending but rather dispelling. When the battle song was used, one's fear and hesitation vanished from the mind. 
She added that it wasn't necessary to use it immediately. Suddenly, another beep notified again that a new war song had been added to his favorites. Hart continued, explaining that among the miscellaneous rewards, the most important one was the borrowed power from the 14 major stars in the sky, transformed into a battle banner. She explained the significance of the five battle flags that each brought a stat boost to the army. She detailed the effects of each banner, starting at orange banner buff, Alcade, which increased the speed of one side charge, blue banner buff, Alker, which boosted one side morale, gray banner buff, Mizar, which improved one's own side's cohesion, pink banner buff, Alif, which weakened enemies' morale, and lastly, black banner buff, Megrez, which boosted one's own side's fighting spirit. She proceeded to explain that each team could only use one battle flag within a range of 1,000 meters but the effects could be stacked on each other. She emphasized that the stronger the effects would be greater with higher morale in their army. Hart reminded Cheng Dalei to use the banners well. Moments later, still in the night study room, Kin Man, Gao Fei, Xilong, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei gathered outside. Zhang Fei initiated by asking why Cheng Dalei summoned them at such a late hour. Cheng Dalei responded, explaining that he had commissioned someone to design the five battle flags, and he was entrusting them with this responsibility. He handed the power flag to Guan Yu, the wicked flag to Gao Fei and Gao Hu, the ruinous flag to Kin Man due to his brave nature, the finance flag to Xilong, and the treasury flag to Zhang Fei. Cheng Dalei elaborated that, in addition to providing them with the battle flags, he was shifting the strategy of Toad Village from defense to offense. He also mentioned having gunpowder, which would be more than enough to deal with the heavily armored soldiers. However, he emphasized that soldiers who could carry hundreds of pounds of iron armor into battle were rare talents among them, especially when gathered in a group. He brought out that the main topic of the night was not just to deal with Mo Mingmi's heavily armored soldiers, but also to find a way to kill Mo Mingmi. After three days rest, Mo Mingmi launched a major attack. War catapults and ladders were assembled and were now put into use. And the time they were no longer testing or stalling for time, but they wanted to take down Cheng Dalei in one fell swoop. The heavily armored soldiers were responsible for the main attack, blocking the attack and opening a path for the following troops to climb up the city wall. The soldiers continued to advance, saying to kill, and commented on where to position the heavy crossbow supposedly claiming it couldn't shoot down, and ordered to go. They were undeterred and continued climbing the ladders as they moved forward to attack. Observing the situation, Cheng Dalei ordered his archers to shoot at the heavily armored soldiers on the ladders. However, he realized that the arrows were unable to get through. Cheng Dalei swiftly commanded his archers to stand down, asserting that the enemy troops were in range. He called upon his sailors, instructing them to bring out what they prepared for the last three days. He commanded his sailors to pour, allegedly pouring a bucket filled with water down onto the armored soldiers who climbed, causing them to slip and shout in frustration. The weather was cold, and the dripping water turned into ice. Hundred pounds of iron armor were not easy to move when the water was poured. Hundreds of heavily armored soldiers in the vanguards were frozen. Cheng Dalei, determined to counter the enemy, issued another command to kill and ordered his troops to go out and attack. He called Kin Man, Xilong, Zhang Fei, Gao Fei, and Gao Hu squads, as well as Xiao Yu and Ling Chong. With a resounding roar, Cheng Dalei's squads charged into battle, determined to face Mo Mingmi's troops in the showdown at Toad Village, the clash of the best of the best. On the other side, Mo Mingmi's troops informed that Cheng Dalei's men were coming out. Mo Mingmi expressed satisfaction, commending their excellence, and mentioned that the last time Kin Man, Xilong, and Zhang Fei were able to escape, and warned them not to try to escape this time. Excitement is visible on his face as he commands his troops to kill them. As the battle unfolded, Xilong commented that the heavily armored soldiers were not enough to be feared, highlighting that their defense was strong but lacked mobility. Kin Man also mentioned that with the cavalry, they could easily slaughter small groups of troops, as the heavy armor acted like an unmoving turtle shell. Jiang Fei reiterated that the objective was to kill Mo Mingmi, while Guan Yu emphasized the great achievement that whoever could kill Mo Mingmi. Gao Fei mentioned that he could boast in the village for a year after this. Cheng Dalei commanded them to get into formation, emphasizing that the six squads would work together to break through the enemy's formation. The auras from the five flags are layered. If you looked at them with Cheng Dalei's eyes, Toad Village warriors are covered with layer after layer of aura. As the five squads slaughtered Mo Mingmi's troops, the five banners continuously boosted, enhancing their side's morale, increasing the speed of their charge, boosting their side's fighting spirit, improving their side's cohesion, and weakening the enemy's morale. 
Kin Man led the charge, shouting commands to kill, while on the opposing side, Mo Ming Mi's troops warned him that he must retreat. However, Mo Ming Mi repeatedly insulted the Toad Village, claiming they were nothing more than a bunch of bandits. The sounds of killing were incessant, the battle flags were staggering, and soldiers were losing their armor. Mo Ming Mi's troops urged him to leave first, claiming they could hold off the Toad Village forces. However, realizing they couldn't withstand them, they eventually decided to retreat. Yet, the momentum of the Toad Village is like a tiger. No matter how reluctant he was, the situation was over, Mo Mingmi was unable to achieve victory and could only flee in embarrassment under the escort of his guards, leaving behind only the ground full of corpses and fallen siege equipment. Xing Zai praises Cheng Dale's men were truly fierce and pointing out that they defeated 10,000 opponents with just 3,000, creating a mess. Chuckled, Cheng Dale sarcastically replied that the enemy was too weak. Xing Zai highlighted that it looked like Cheng Dale won already. Boastfully, Cheng Dale responded that he was a master of cheat, suggesting that if he could defeat those weaklings, he might as well use frozen tofu to beat himself to death. Confused, Xing Zai stammered while trying to grasp the word cheat and wondered what Cheng Dale was saying, as he could not understand. Cheng Dale only responded with a sly laugh. Cheng Dale reflected on the realization he had back at King New Mountain when he fought the rings. In his eyes, the world was within reach. Although he found the unlimited exchange of fear points and gunpowder alone enough to wipe out the entire empire. But the world obtained through the process brought nothing but ruin which he found unattractive. Instead, he contemplated fixing the broken empire in the direction he liked. After the battle, Cheng Dale ordered his men to clean up the battlefield and count the spoils of the battle. More than 1,000 ordinary soldiers and 500 heavily armored soldiers were captured. Cheng Dale was ready to convince them, hoping that more people would join the Toad Village. A beep sounded as he saw soldier-type heavily armored soldiers. The people in Mo Mingmi's camp fled, but all the supplies were left behind. A person asked if they were Mo Mingmi, and another person responded that he managed to escape. In reaction, the person expressed pity. Amidst the aftermath of the battle, Cheng Dale and his forces discovered a substantial number of resources, several armor sets and weapons, 300 war horses, engineering carts, catapults, several tents, and countless supplies. Cheng Dale obtained a lot. Meanwhile, in descending Jade Village, Li Hu reflected on her happiness at Shenji's powerful presence, noting that the enemy troops didn't put up a fight. With a blank expression, Shenji responded, while Ling'er asked Shenji if the enemy left. Ironically, the enemy and the leader were defeated. The news that Cheng Dale defeated Mo Mingmi in the frontal battlefield spread like wildfire. Mo Mingmi suffered heavy losses. Many focused on Kinchuan now fully trusted Cheng Dale. He dominated Kinchuan for many years, relying on the Kinchuan border city. Now, it seemed that only the one who held this border of Kinchuan could be considered the rightful lord of Kinchuan. At this point, the fourth assault was over. At night, in the Toad Village meeting hall, Zhonglong greeted, and Cheng Dale welcomed him, and asked everyone to take a seat and not be overly cautious as they were all family. Cheng Dale explained that he called them together to discuss how they could launch an attack on the Kinchuan border. Gao Fei hesitated for a moment and questioned Cheng Dale about his intentions to attack the Kinchuan border. Cheng Dale confirmed it and that he not only wanted to defeat Mo Mingmi but also to capture the Kinchuan border and take over that place. He mentioned that Zhonglong, Kaiohi, and Yu Jialu were more knowledgeable about the situation of the Kinchuan border than he was. Yu Jialu asked Cheng Dale how many men he thought would be needed to attack a city like Kinchuan. Determined, Cheng Dale responded that they defeated Mo Mingmi on the frontal battlefield. He emphasized the moment when Mo Mingmi lost all his troops and lieutenants, and his morale dropped and highlighted that it was a good time for them to beat the dog in the water. Kaio he emphasized that Kinchuan had high walls and a significant number of soldiers, noting that it was not easy to take it down. Also, Zhonglong added that even though many Kinchuan troops were killed in the last battle, their numbers still far exceeded those of the Toad Village. He expressed concern, stating that attacking Kinchuan would be no different from sending themselves to their deaths. Cheng Dale highlighted that Kinchuan was guarded by at least 22,000 soldiers and mentioned the 10 besieged, which means that the number of people besieging the city should be at least 10 times the number of defending the city. But the Toad Village only had 7,000 people, and he feared that only about 4,000 could fight. Xing Zai chimed in and suggested that they attack Kinchuan at night for a better chance of winning. But Cheng Dale responded that it was difficult as Kinchuan was in a state of war readiness, and Mo Mingmi's eyes were constantly watching their side all the time. 
Xing Zai pointed out that if they mobilized their troops, it would put Kinchuan on high alert. Cheng Dale questioned them if there was a way to make the guards at Kinchuan let down their guard. Kaio he cautioned Cheng Dale to be careful. Cheng Dale suggested that if they couldn't break through from the outside, perhaps they could start from the inside. But someone asked how they could sneak in. Cheng Dale thought if there was any power within Kinchuan that they could turn against Mo Mingmi. He asked Xing Zai, who once worked in a mine in Kinchuan. As Cheng Dale was about to ask him, Xing Zai immediately dismissed his idea, stating there were no tunnels, and even if there were, they wouldn't be suitable for an army to infiltrate. But Cheng Dale clarified that he wasn't referring to tunnels but rather the miners. Curiously, Xing Zai questioned what a group of slaves could do. The meeting lasted till late, but no suitable method was discussed. Alone in the night, Cheng Dale sat in contemplation. Suddenly, Su Ying approached him while carrying a tray. She asked if he didn't want to join the celebration happening outside. Cheng Dale responded that today was not the time for celebration. The real celebration would be held after they suppressed Kinchuan. Su Ying sat down beside him, expressing concern that he had been pushing himself too hard lately. While sipping the hot tea, Cheng Dale asked if he was. She claimed that she could see that behind him, there seemed to be an immortal helping him. And she shared her thoughts about everyone going to study and that going on a road that had never been seen before. She hoped that fewer of their men would die during the war. She acknowledged the desired speed was yet to be achieved but emphasized that some things could not be rushed. In frustration, Cheng Dale mentioned that it seemed like the best opportunity to attack Kinchuan. Once Mo Mingmi caught his breath, it would be challenging to take over Kinchuan again. Su Ying said that if that was the case, she wished to be part of the meeting and offered to share responsibility for that too. Su Ying suggested they start planning the wedding. Cheng Dale was taken aback, wondering why at that time. Observing Su Ying with a furrowed brow, he questioned her intentions. In response, Su Ying simply nodded and asserted that Toad Village needed a name, one that would enable his men to act without being suspicious of Kinchuan spies. She highlighted the best reason was to prepare for Cheng Dale's wedding. Even so, Cheng Dale expressed his sentiment that the wedding seemed to have become tasteless. He wished to make it a little more pure. Su Ying, however, dismissed his concern, stating that it didn't matter to her, acknowledging her role as a supportive wife. She noted that in times of conflict, her only recourse was to silently pray to God and worship Buddha for her husband's well-being. Her eyes filled with love, Su Ying continued, stating that they needed to be careful to survive in these chaotic times. She expressed concern if Cheng Dale couldn't come back, she wouldn't be able to live anymore. However, she urged him to think about how to face other people amidst wedding matters, considering that some may not like it. She brought up Liu Zhai, describing her as clingy and suggested not to care about her feelings and to leave her out. She also mentioned Li Hua, emphasizing that she's not older and highlighting her character, stating that she should become the wife of a large family. Su Ying advised Cheng Dale that if he missed such a strange woman like Li Hua, it would be difficult for him to find one in his second life. Su Ying shared that she had been dealing with them a lot recently, emphasizing to Cheng Dale that he shouldn't let them down. She also mentioned Jidao, noting that she shouldn't be counted. Su Ying playfully accused Cheng Dale of being a merciless womanizer who kept his lovers around and jokingly threatened to bite him to death. Suddenly, Cheng Dale screamed as he urged Su Ying to be gentle. 